The Undead, Day 1 to Day 3, by R. R. Haywood. Read by Dan Morgan. My name is Howie. I was named after my father, Howard, but it became too confusing to have two Howards, so I became Howie. I'm 27 years old, and I work as a night manager in a supermarket. This is my account. Day 1. Friday. Chapter 1 The unseasonably hot weather has caught us all out, not just our store, but stores right across the region. Head office are working round the clock to get the summer seasonal stock out to us. In the meantime, if we get customer inquiries, then please, please, and I say it again, please, direct the customer to our online services and assist them with in-store ordering. Also, try to remind them they can purchase online and collect in store. My God, this is boring. I'm hot and uncomfortable. Being the night manager means most of this doesn't apply to me, as I can't see our usual quota of taxi drivers, drunks and whatever other poor sods coming into the store at night asking why we don't have our Bermuda shorts on offer yet, or why we have only got ten different sun creams instead of over bloody thirty. On to other news, the morning managers have reported a definite improvement on the readiness of the store for the daily trade. That, in my opinion, is down to the appointment of the new night's manager. Shit, that's me. This is like being in school when the teacher is droning on and then suddenly stops and looks at you. Then everyone else looks at you and you get that fluttery, panicked feeling of missing the question. Uh. I sit up properly instead of slouching back with my legs stretched out. Looking round, I can see the other managers are all smiling at me. Apart from Paul, that is. We have seen an increase in trade during the hours of darkness, too, the general manager continues. A drop in staff sickness and absence. He peers down at a sheet of paper in front of him. Wastage has been reduced by over 20% and... He looks up at me with that genial smile. Unbelievably, we have seen an actual increase in sales of our promotional offers during nights, which, ladies and gentlemen, he casts his eyes round the room, is unheard of for a 24-7 store, not only within our chain, but all the major chains. I hate that fucking phrase. 24-7. It's just so... So, so, Howie, the floor is yours, the general manager looks to me. Please impart how you have achieved this within three months of being appointed. Paul is glaring. Can't blame him, really. He was the night's manager for 12 months and sat in these meetings every two weeks, moaning about how it was all so different at night and you don't understand the pressures we're under. Different? Pressure? The only difference is that it's dark outside, and as for pressure, the bloody store hardly has any sodding customers cluttering the place up and making a mess. Ha! I start off with a blurt of laughter, then inwardly curse myself for doing it. Yeah, great start, Howie. Really great. Um, well, we kind of, uh, just worked a bit harder, I offer while feeling a spreading blush creeping up my cheeks. Specifics, Howie? the manager asks, urging me to share my excellent managerial skills. Head office are interested and want to know what is being done differently. Oh, that causes a ripple through the shark pool. These career-hungry bastards have just heard the words head office and interested in the same sentence. To have head office interested is either the precursor to a death sentence or something glittery and gold. Paul isn't glaring now. The poor sod has dropped his head and looks beat, completely beat, like he's ready to start making a noose for himself. Specifics, I say slowly while rubbing my jaw to try and look all clever and serious. Well, uh, staff absence is down because... Uh, what do I say? The night staff have been the night staff since time began. 
They are a collection of misfits and folk who, for many reasons, just don't like working in the day. Be that because they have a general hatred of humanity, or an almost vampire-like existence where the sight of the sun would burn them to death, no one knows. I can't tell the general manager it's down to the quick poker session we have during the lunch break, can I? Shit, that's really not allowed. Like, really not allowed. I think it's only too easy to see the staff simply as resources and not as humans with feelings and emotions. Oh shit, stop, Howie. So in order to maximise the efficiency of the night staff, I simply make the working environment a nice place to be. Howie, stop. Really stop now. We all get on with each other and, uh, well, I may have bent the old rule, not broken I hasten to add, Jesus, Tesco rules are carved in stone and carry a sentence of death by firing squad. What rules? The general manager barks, suddenly losing his enthusiastic persona. Uh, well, the spreading of breaks is the main one, really. I know during the day you have to make sure the break times are staggered, but on nights we go down to a skeleton crew, which is rotated, and we take our breaks together, which helps build a feeling of camaraderie. Right. The general manager nods slowly as though he's just been told the secret to immortality. Wastage? Wastage? I shift again. The reduction in wastage is down to getting barred from the poker game if you break anything. Uh, just being, like, really careful? I nod. The increase in promotional sales? The general manager prompts. Everyone is staring at me now, apart from Paul, who is almost weeping into his mug of tea. Yeah, the promotional sales. Whoever gets the most gets the first hand for free in the following night's poker game. Promotional sales? Well, that's just down to uh, an increase in promotional awareness and outlining the benefits of maximising sales and how those benefits cascade down to everyone. Good. The general manager nods with interest. Very good. A rising star in our midst, ladies and gentlemen, and someone to watch out for. He beams round the room, happy again. Cheers for that. I'll be testing my tea for poison now and watching out for trip wires next to the big waste-crushing machines. Keep it up, Howie, and you'll be back on days before you know it. Finally... He turns his attention to someone else as his eyes shift to the produce manager for an update on why sales of turnips have gone down. Thank fuck that's over. I hate these meetings, but the good thing is that they earn me an extra night off. I work in the day so I can attend the meeting, and I'm allowed to finish early. It's Friday night, so I'll stick around until my lot start at 9pm, then be off home for junk food, sofa and maybe even a couple of beers. Eventually the meeting ends... And suddenly I've got a whole bunch of new friends. Even the gorgeous cashier manager gives me a smile, which just makes me blush and walk into the back of a chair. Well done, Howie. Steve, the home deliveries manager, pats me on the back. Head office, eh? Someone else nods meaningfully at me. Duty managers, shift managers, staff managers, more managers than you can shake a stick at, but Tesco worked to a formula... And as much as we all moan about corporate greed, they're bloody good at it. The only problem with being alternated to work a late shift instead of a night to attend the meeting is that all the managers are required to be at work at the same time. Which translates to no spare office space, no free computers to work from, and not even a spare desk to sit at while the rest of them polish their name badges and slick their hair down. Instead, I stroll about the store and smile at people while carrying some bits of paper, Always works, that does. Five o'clock, and the mass exodus of office people are running out to the store to start doing whatever normal people do on Friday nights. I get some office space and a computer and get my shit together as the evening rolls on while listening to my small FM radio, broken out of my drawer, now the other tie-wearing bastards have all gone home. By nine o'clock, I'm pretty much finished and stretching back. Reports from Reuters suggest the riot was sparked by one assailant biting into several members of the public within the shopping centre. Did he just say biting? Bloody hell. Grabbing the radio, I twist the volume knob and focus on the news report. 
Details are still sketchy, but we do know the area is being flooded with police in an effort to bring order. Evening, Owie. Glancing up, I miss the rest of the report as Bert walks smartly into the office. Bert, how are you? I greet the older man with a smile as I start rolling my sleeves up properly. He gives me a look as he stares at the sleeves half rolled up my forearms and my hasty efforts to correct them. Smartness makes the man, he smiles amiably. He's grey-haired and well into his sixties, but Bert screams ex-army. His shoes gleam from being relentlessly bulled, his trousers have razor-sharp creases running down the front, and his sleeves are either down and fastened properly or rolled up above the elbow with exact precision, something he likes to remind me about when he sees me wandering about with mine all over the place. Meeting okay, was it? he asks, taking a radio from the charging unit. Fine. Profits up, wastage down, sickness down. They're very happy. Didn't mention the poker games, then, he chuckles. Funny that. No, I didn't. I laugh as he adjusts his black tie. He is one of the night security guards and holds the coveted position of CCTV controller staying within the secure room to watch the millions of live feeds from the millions of cameras dotted about the store. Oh well, what they don't know won't hurt them. You're off tonight, aren't you? Oh yes, I grin, locking my fingers together behind my head, I stretch out. Pizza, beer and my sofa. Young man like you, he tuts. Should be out finding yourself a nice woman. Or a bad one, he adds with a wink. Yeah, one day. I'm still holding out for the cashier manager. She actually smiled at me today. Did she now? He chuckles. You best go buy a ring then. Yeah, all right, I laugh. Here, have you heard the news? Something about a riot and someone biting. Caught the tail end of it as I was leaving home. Uh, somewhere in Europe, I think. Oh, not here then. God, no, he shakes his head. Storm in a teacup somewhere. Oh. Losing interest, I put my radio down and start getting ready to go. In the corridor, I can hear the night staff gradually filing in, and there is a definite difference in them. Three months ago, and they were sullen, withdrawn, and stayed in horrible little cliques. Now, though, I can hear them laughing and sharing jokes, all of them avoiding mentioning the poker game for fear of the late shift staff hearing them. That was it. It was something we have the others don't. A secret thing that we can all enjoy with a sense of doing it together. The poker games were only ever for a couple of quid, and the biggest the pot ever went up to was something like a fiver. Evening. Stepping out of the office, I call down to the men and women gathered by the lockers, getting a chorus of replies in return. Happy people smiling and joking, and it almost makes me want to stay at work. Almost. Mr Howie. Turning round, I see Dave, one of the night shelf stackers standing there. Dave, how are you? I don't bother trying to correct him calling me Mr. Howie. I've said it to him loads of times, but he still does it. Fine, thank you, Mr. Howie. He nods briefly, then walks past towards his locker. Dave, we had a meeting today. Performance is up, wastage and everything bad is down. So, uh He stares at me with a completely blank face. Well, the offer is still there if you want to move on to working days. No, thank you, he replies dully. A hard-working man, exceptionally quiet and reserved, he never joins in with the banter, the jokes or anything. He works and he works hard. His breaks are kept to a minimum and even during his long meal break, he takes enough time to eat and then goes back to work. Mind you, no one ever takes the piss out of him either. He's small, but something about him just discourages any stupid comments. OK, well, let me know if you change your mind. OK, Mr Howie. I'm off tonight. He stares at me without expression. So, uh, have a good night. I smile. He nods and walks off.
no personal belongings to put in his locker, no change of clothes, and he's out onto the shop floor to start work. Wishing them a pleasant evening and getting some mild, well-meaning abuse for having a night off, I make my way out and start the walk home. It's a beautiful warm night, sultry even, and it feels more like summer in Spain than the south of England. Borough Fair is a nice enough town, close to the sea, but inland enough to avoid being classed as a resort town. Mid-size, and it's the same as everywhere else, with lots of houses surrounding a town centre. My place is just off the centre. Noisy, but cheap, and I have the top half of a house with a young couple living underneath me. A residential side street with brick-built houses and slate roofs. Average as average can be. The quickest route is through the side streets, but it shaves a minute off the journey at most, and tonight is so warm I walk back through the high street watching the crowds of people moving from pub to pub. It's packed, really busy. I guess with the universities on holiday and the hot weather, it's drawing everyone into the centre. People laughing and singing noisily makes me think of my sister living in London. Sarah is a PA for one of the big investment banks or something like that. She moved there a few years ago and has told me about the Friday and Saturday night networking parties. Having a rare night off, I kind of feel like I want to join in and be out with the crowds drinking and having fun, but it's not really my scene. I'm not fashion conscious or stylish and I don't go in for whatever the latest fad is. I'm 27 and still shy as hell around pretty girls. It's only been the last few years that my hair has started looking even remotely decent. Dark, curly, too long and permanently messy. I don't work out or do anything other than work and piss about at home. I am the average man. Pausing at the door of the pizza place, I spot fat bloke inside. I've never learnt what his name is, but I know he likes drinking. He comes into the supermarket most weekends, tanked up and swaying, while he buys loads of junk food, crisps, chocolate, pies and frozen chips. I feel bad calling him fat bloke, as he's a nice man, always polite and jovial, willing to share a joke and never aggressive like some of the drunks are. Looks professional too, from the nice suit he's always got on. It's just one of those things. Time rolls on and you end up meeting people time and again until suddenly it's too late to be asking their name. Hello, mate. I grin, joining him at the counter. Hi. He grins and even holds a hand out. Supermarket man, yeah? Hi. How are you? He's sober, but still really friendly. And this early in the evening, I can see his tie is done up properly and he looks sharp and switched on. Fine. I nod back amiably. Night off. Good for you. Having a pizza, eh? Don't blame you. They're nice here. Have you tried the meat feast? Oh, yes. I give him a knowing grin. You enjoy it, then? Working at Tesco, I mean. I heard they look after their managers quite well. Yeah, it's not bad, I shrug. Lucky to have a job these days. True, he sighs. So you out then, or off home? Pizza and home for me. Really? Young bloke like you on a Friday night? Come and have a beer with me if you like. He means it too. Not a fake, polite offer, but a genuine one. No, thanks anyway. As much as I'm sure it would be nice, the town centre at weekends really isn't my scene. Too many pumped up lads wearing t-shirts two sizes too small for them and women screaming into mobile phones. We make small talk until the pizzas are handed over in their lovely warm cardboard boxes. Exchanging polite farewells, I make my way through the town to the side street and down to my flat. I'm on the first floor, so the windows have been left open, but there's no breeze to speak of. Television on, quick change of clothes, a couple of cold ones from the fridge, and within seven minutes of walking in, I'm sitting on the sofa eating the first slice of thick crust meat feast while flicking through the channels. Naturally, being a Friday and off work for the night, I check the movies out first, but they're all old ones I've seen many times. Next, I check for something funny, but again, it's all repeats, dramas, repeats, documentaries, repeats. Out of sheer desperation, I flick higher through the numbers until I start hitting the news channels and see the footage of the riots they mentioned earlier on the radio. Some of the footage is awful. 
And I mean awful. It's poor quality and obviously snatched by low-resolution cameras in poor light. Some of it, however, isn't awful. Some is high definition and taken by someone using a modern phone who at least knows how to hold their hand still. Full colour, full audio, and utterly shocking. People with obvious injuries run by. Wounds to their faces and necks, bleeding, with noses or ears ripped away. Police officers fire handguns into crowds of bystanders. Then more police officers, using shotguns and assault rifles. SWAT teams and riot police are deployed, and it strikes me that in this modern age, the police look the same the world over. What is obvious is that it's been spreading, and even I have started to recognise some of the places they're talking about. Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Germany, from Eastern Europe into Central and the Southern countries. Reports from further afield have grown as Russian news agencies have started reporting mass civil uprisings. The news anchors are in heaven. You can see it in their faces. And I bet the notes they're making on the bits of paper in front of them are in preparation for whatever awards news agencies give each other. Fingers push into ears as the anchors listen to producers. When the main news channels show disasters, they seize on one or two bits of footage and loop it over and over while going through their list of experts to either phone up or get them into the studio. With this event, it's different. They've been swamped with footage, and after the first hour or so, I don't think I see the same bit twice. As the night wears on, all the news channels stick to that one story, and I listen with interest as they talk about civil uprising, and how the recession has led to millions of people becoming dissatisfied with the austerity measures imposed by corrupt politicians. The funny thing is that I'm quite calm at first thinking all these places are a billion light years away and just weird, crazy European cultures having a squabble that would never, could never affect this country. England, however, has a long history with rioters and it isn't long before I start to think maybe all those council estate kids in London might flare up again and start looting JD Sports and Argos. The one thing that does scream out is the reports of the numbers of people biting each other. As those details start to come through, you can tell the news anchors are starting to worry. That worry has increased as the violence spreads out into Western Europe, hitting countries like Switzerland, Luxembourg, Belgium and France. France? Bloody hell. That's only a few hours away from where I live. Yeah, fair enough, you've got to get a ferry or a train under the channel. The channel tunnel. The tunnel that connects France to England. Shit. The realisation seems to hit across the board. News anchors are loosening ties, unbuttoning top buttons of shirts, sleeves are getting rolled up. This is getting serious. There's no mistaking the next bit of footage. The bloody Eiffel Tower is in the background, with masses of people running and screaming. More gunshots. Pistols first, then the sustained firing of automatic weapons. Suddenly the reasons given for it change. The anchors start talking about pandemics, contagions and a fast-acting virus spread by airborne particles or transferred by bodily fluids. Time and again, witness reports state that people are being bitten to death. Only they don't stay dead. They get back up and start biting other people. My pizza is half eaten, the first can of beer only halfway through. This isn't the Friday night I expected to be having, slouched back with my feet on the coffee table. Instead, I'm on the very edge of my sofa, staring with wide eyes, for I have never seen anything like this. Censorship has been thrown out of the window, and the raw footage of people being killed is sickening. I can't help myself flick up and down the channels, trying to see the difference between the news reports, but they're all the same. When the first channel starts to transmit the technical error message, I don't really pay too much attention, but flick past it in a hurry to see the developments. Then Euronews goes down. The screen just blank for a few minutes until the technical error message appears. Sky News reports they are losing contact with outside agencies. BBC News loses satellite connections. Things start breaking. Phone calls drop out. And for the first time in what is probably television history, the news anchors start to panic. With a shock, I realise it's gone one o'clock in the morning. I've been glued to the television for hours. 
then it dawns on me just how fast this thing is spreading. Still, we have received no government updates. This is a live request for any government official with knowledge or advice to be given to the people of the United Kingdom to make contact with either our news department or any of the main broadcast news agencies. Fuck me. They're asking for the government to get in touch, literally asking if anybody is watching to phone them. Flicking through the channels, the same request is being made live by multiple news anchors as they beg for someone to tell them what to do. My stomach is churning. I feel sick with worry. Sarah, my sister, is in central London, and on a night like this, she'll be out in some swanky wine bar. Paris is only a few hours' train ride from London. Got to call her, tell her to get home and lock the doors. No signal on my phone. The circle with the bar through it is in the corner, indicating no network coverage. I live right by the town. The coverage here is excellent. I turn it off and back on, hoping it's my phone playing up. It isn't. Still no signal. Landline, then. I dust the thing off and have to use my mobile phone to find Sarah's number. I'm halfway through pushing the numbers before I realise there is no dial tone. Nothing. Just an empty, faint hiss. I press the clicker down several times, but that makes no difference. Tracing the cable, it's still connected in the wall. Several times I try the mobile and the landline, dialing numbers, but both are inactive. Even 999 doesn't work. Pacing about my small lounge, I glance back at the television. What I see stops me in my tracks. Sky News, BBC News, ITV News. All of them are gone. Just blank screens from one channel to the next. Flicking through, there are no channels broadcasting now. Just blank screen after blank screen. Even the technical error messages are gone. What do I do? No mobile, no landline, no contact with anyone. My parents live in the next town along, just a few miles away. But at this time of night, they'll be tucked up in bed. With the television off, and just standing there thinking frantically, I hear the noise from outside quite clearly. Footsteps, heavy and going fast. Someone running. At my lounge window, I peer right, then left, until I see someone running down the street, coming away from the town centre. A big man, by the looks of it, but he's still shifting quickly despite his size. As he gets closer, I spot him giving fast, furtive glances behind him. The closer he gets, the clearer I see those glances are panicked and worried, like someone's chasing him. Fat bloke. Definitely him. Running down my street in his smart suit... The tie is pulled down now and several of the top buttons of his shirt are undone. I catch movement back in the shadows further up the street. Leaning out, I can see several more people running in the same direction, only they are going much faster than he is and gaining quickly. It seems to be them he's running away from because as they get closer, he gets more panicked. Even in the streetlights, I can see his face is flushed bright red and he's breathing very hard. Poor bastard will have a heart attack if he doesn't slow down. Coming into the light and the group's dynamics scream out. The way they're running, all stiff-legged and weird with no clear cohesion to their movements. The same manner of movement I saw in that footage. But this is Borough Fair, a small market town in the middle of bloody nowhere. How the hell can this get affected? Fat bloke is muttering in panic now, whimpering as he senses the group is gaining. Here! I yell out, waving my arms to draw his attention. He hears me and stares round in shock, so I have to keep shouting until he can get the direction. My front door is locked, he won't be able to get through. A couple of quick steps and I'm out of my lounge and into my tiny hallway opening my flat door. Down the stairs, past the door to the downstairs flat and I get to the main front door, wrenching it open to step outside. He's still a little way off and clearly struggling to maintain speed. With my front door ajar, I run down the garden path and into the street, waving my arms for him and shouting for him to keep going. They're bloody close to him now, maybe five or six of them, men and women, and all of them dressed like they've just come from the town. The next few seconds are a blur. Fat bloke seems to realise he's done for, and there's no more running left in him. Coming to a quick stop, 
He turns to lash out, but the way they all dive into him takes him off his feet within the blink of an eye. Not a rugby tackle or something from the sports field, but full-on hurtling headfirst into his body. The whole lot of them doing it at the same time. Fat bloke screams. A high-pitched wail full of pain that freezes the blood in my veins. I start moving towards him. But even from this distance, I can see the people are tearing at his flesh with their teeth. Fucking hell, they're actually biting him, ripping him apart with their mouths, tearing into his face, neck and arms. His clothes are bloodied and stained within seconds. Blood is everywhere as it soaks into the ground and sprays on the attackers in powerful pumps. What the hell's going on? An old man in his pyjamas is striding out of his front door, angry and shouting that he's going to call the police. I'm bloody sick of you lot coming from the town and bloody fighting every night. The speed they move from fat bloke to old man is frightening, like a pack of animals that suddenly wants the fresh meat instead of the carcass on the ground. Up they burst and into him with the same frenzied manner. He screams out in rage at first, then fear, which quickly becomes the same wails of pain that the fat bloke gave off. I've got to do something. I feel compelled to help, but there's nothing I can do. Starting to step backwards towards my front garden, I get the overwhelming sensation to go slowly in case they see me. Lights come on a few doors away from the group and a thick set man comes flying out the front door in his boxer shorts while brandishing a baseball bat. He doesn't hesitate but goes straight at them, whacking left and right as he tries to bat them off the old boy. Wincing from the sound of wood striking skulls, I watch as they get hit hard, stagger away, but quickly recover and switch their attention from the old man they were just eating to this new one. He hits out and gets some good shots, really good shots, the sort of shots that would see the average man going to hospital with a fractured skull. But they don't flinch, and within seconds he's off his feet and on the ground too. I didn't see his wife come out, but there she is, phone in hand, while she screams at them to leave him alone. She even tries grabbing the long hair of a female attacker to pull her away, but just gets lunged at instead. The female attacker launches up to bite straight into the woman's face. She holds her ground and for a second, the pair of them stagger around while thrashing violently. Screams and howls fill the air. More people rushing from homes. Lights coming on and shouts of alarm. People yelling that they're calling the police. Back at my gate now and I'm steadily creeping back to my front door. The attacking group have moved further into the street and seem to lunge from person to person as quickly as they come running out of their homes. Glancing right, I see Fat Bloke going from prone to sitting up in what must be his first sit-up in 15 years. Slowly, he gets to his feet, and I stop creeping back, thinking maybe if he gets up, he can still get inside my house before they see him again. On his feet now and he staggers round, legs heavy and awkward, blood streams down his face, down his front and all over his ripped suit. Waving silently, I try to get his attention without calling out. As he turns towards me, I get the creeping realisation of how utterly stupid I am. Having watched hours of footage and hearing over and over again how people are getting bitten to death and then getting back up, and here I am. Having watched someone getting bitten to death, and now he's got back up, and I'm waving at him like a bloody lunatic. His head is lolling in a random, jerky manner, arms hanging loosely, and like the others, he walks with stiff legs that don't seem to bend at the knees. It's like he's got no control over his fine motor skills. The most striking thing is the eyes. The red, bloodshot eyes that catch the light from the sodium lights overhead. Out in the quiet residential street in front of my building, and I realised coming out here was a stupid thing to do. I sprint for my front door as I see Simon, my downstairs neighbour, coming out of his flat. What's going on? He looks half asleep, dressed in tracksuit bottoms with no top on. Get back inside! Reaching the front door, I try to push him back and close it. He recoils at the contact to stare at me with distaste. What's up with you? He asks. What's going on? Get the door shut and keep your voice down. Don't tell me what to do. 
he sneers. I've not had much contact with my neighbours, Simon and Laura, but what little I've had has left me thinking the bloke is a bit of a prick. Mate, seriously, close the fucking door! I glance back while Simon keeps a firm grip on the handle, refusing to let me shut it. Simon, everyone is biting each other and... What? He scowls. You pissed up? No! Close the fucking door! I try pulling it from his grasp. Simon, I'm trying to sleep. Laura appears in the doorway of their flat in her bra and knickers. How he's pissed, Simon says as though it explains everything. No, I'm not, I reply, still trying ineffectually to get the door closed. Thing is, being an average English bloke, I don't want to physically push him away. Making bodily contact with someone else like that is heavily frowned upon. I know he wants to push me away too, but is holding back. So we end up playing a tug of war with the front door. Well, I'm telling the landlord tomorrow, Laura shouts. I've had enough of this. Shut up, I say, turning to see Fat Bloke now shuffling through the garden gate towards us. Don't you fucking tell my bird to shut up. I'm not your bird, Laura says pointedly. Oh, fuck, please, get this door shut, he's coming. Who? Simon looks past me to the garden path. What, him? What's he going to do, sit on you? Oh, Christ, mate, just shut the door, please. Who's he on about? Laura steps out to join Simon looking down the path. He's covered in blood. Here, mate, you all right? Simon, ask him if he's all right. Are you all right, mate? Simon calls out. You've been hurt? Oh, God, I murmur, backing away from the door. Fucking pussy. Stepping out, Simon walks slowly towards Fat Bloke. Christ, mate, what happened? Did you get beaten up? Did he get beaten up? Laura asks. Simon, ask him if he got beaten up. I did. I'll call an ambulance. She disappears inside her flat, coming back with her mobile held in front as she jabs her thumb at the screen. Simon, get back inside, I plead. A man up. Laura snaps while staring in frustration at the phone. Bloody network. Shaking her head, she disappears back into their flat. Simon! I scream in warning, but it's too late. Fat bloke, as slow and as waddling as he was, bursts to life and charges with incredible speed for the last couple of metres, giving Simon no time to react. Head first, he barrels into my neighbour and is already sinking his teeth into his neck as they fall to the floor. This time, I react with instinct and run towards them, grabbing at Fat Bloke in an effort to pull him off, but his sheer weight prevents me doing anything. In desperation, I start beating down on his head as he bites deeper into Simon's neck. Go back! I shout as Laura comes running out, screaming in panic. She goes straight for the man attacking Simon, grabbing at his arms in a vain effort to pull him away. Growling behind me, like the sound of a dog. Turning, I see more of them charging across the street, heading towards us. Laura, now! Go now! I try pulling her arm, but she lashes out, striking me in the face. Trying again, I grab and pull, but she's determined to keep attacking Fat Bloke. Simon has gone quiet, and already I can see his face has gone pale. Blood everywhere, all over me and Laura, and coating Fat Bloke to the point it drips out from his mouth and down his chin. The ones that attacked Fat Bloke come charging through the gate. With no other choice, I run back to the front door, feeling like a complete coward for leaving Laura on her own. But I know what's coming, and there was no way on earth I was going to shift her. Slamming the front door shut, I just catch a glimpse as Laura screams at the people for help. In her panic, she doesn't see the blood or the injuries they carry. Reaching my flat door on the first floor, I get inside to slam it closed before moving into the lounge to stare down out the window. The sight is incredible, and the noise will stay with me forever. Laura is on her back, wearing just bra and knickers with a huge group of already bloodied people pushing their heads into her body, lips pulled back revealing teeth like a wolf would do. Those mouths bite down into any part of her flesh they can access, Legs, arms, neck, torso. One even bites deep into the top of her breast, tearing a chunk of flesh away. She screams and thrashes her legs and arms before being pinned by the body weight of those attacking her. Scanning the street, it looks like a war zone. 
like a huge movie set. More lights in houses are on now. Bodies all over the place and people running about screaming and being chased by single people or groups. Several get taken down as more of the attackers start charging into front doors. The screams and wails of women and children mix with the deeper, harsher tones of men. The worst sound, the very worst sound, is when Laura goes quiet. The lifeblood within her system drains to the point she either dies or passes out, and with her voice gone, I can hear the flesh being ripped from her bones, a squelching, biting noise that reminds me of listening to a dog eating. The first heave comes without warning. The sight of so many dead and torn up bodies is too much to handle, and the vomit propels from my mouth out the window and onto the ground below, hitting with a wet splat. Half-digested pizza, beer and bile all mixed in, burning my throat and making my eyes water. Hearing how much noise I just made, I jolt back to duck down, but the damage is done. After heaving the rest of my gut onto my lounge carpet, I kneel up and peer down to see blood-soaked, torn and ragged faces staring up at me. Fat bloke wasn't the only one to have the red, bloodshot eyes. They all have them. Chapter 2 So here I am, having puked my pizza onto the ground below my window, and then some more over my carpet. I'm tucked down and hiding from the... from the things outside. Breathing hard, I risk another glance and immediately drop back down. They're still there, and I can hear them now as well. Animalistic growling and hissing all mixed in with pain-filled groans. Bollocks, I mutter in a voice at the sight of the horde gathering down there. What do I do? Shit. Shit, shit, shit. Grabbing a coffee mug from the low table behind me, I go back to the window and pull my arm back, causing the cold remains of my coffee to splash in my face, making me spit and stagger around. I launch the mug hard at old pyjama man. Good shot, I congratulate myself. It hits him straight in the face, and he gets knocked back onto his ass. Turning around, I look for something else to throw. The remote control for the television is the closest object, so that gets launched out too and smacks Laura on the shoulder, but she doesn't flinch. Anything within reach is grabbed. Books and DVD cases, even an empty vase gets launched hard and hits a woman on the head, shattering into fragments. She goes down, and I watch in horror as more of them walk over the vase's broken glass, the shards lacerating their feet, but they don't stop moving. Missiles get launched one after the other, which does nothing to stop them, but makes me feel a whole lot better. Movement ripples through them as they start pushing into the communal hallway, having got through the main front door. I run back to my flat door, still closed and locked. I look for items to barricade it, but my hallway is small with no furniture. Running into my bedroom, I grab my bedside drawers and carry it back, putting it behind the front door. I stand back and proudly view my barricade. One small chest of drawers, which cost me about 15 quid from my mum's catalogue, defends me from a horde of bloodthirsty undead. I need more. In the lounge, I sweep the flat screen television off the solid wooden cabinet and start to drag it towards the door. But the DVD player and satellite box are still in the cabinet plugged into the wall. The cabinet refuses to budge, the wires taut and holding. I open the glass doors and yank them out, forcing the leads to break while I swear foully under my breath. The cabinet is stacked behind the door, and I spend the next few seconds trying to position the chest of drawers on top of it before realising that one cabinet and one chest of drawers won't be stopping anyone. Next, the low coffee table is added to my barricade. I keep going, dragging or carrying whatever I can find until I get my heavy double mattress and stuff that into the pile. It's not great, but it will slow them down. My stomach plummets as I step back and hear the first thumps and bangs coming from the other side of the door. Running back into the lounge, I check out the window. Beneath me is a large crowd of them that can't get into the front door as the hallway is crammed. They're still trying to move forward, though, pressing into each other with groans and weird animal noises. There must be dozens of them, crowding towards the front of the building, with more coming from across the street. Nothing else for it, but back to Howie's missile launching. I look around and see the DVD player on the floor. I pick it up, raise it high, then slam it down into the middle of the crowd as hard as I can. It smashes into the head of one of them, amid the heart of the throng. I can't tell if it was a man or a woman. 
but I see it go down, and its space is quickly filled as they all push forward again. Then I do the same with the satellite receiver box, smashing it down into the middle of the crowd. I don't wait to see the damage, but instead I run around the flat, grabbing anything small enough to throw. In the kitchen, I spot the kettle. It's an electric stainless steel one, nice and heavy. I grab it and start back to the lounge, stopping after a few steps to turn back to the kitchen where I quickly fill the kettle with water and switch it on. I grab everything I can. Pans, plates, cups, bowls, the sugar and coffee pots and the bread bin. They're all carried into the lounge and dumped by the window before I scurry back for more missiles. The kitchen is filled with steam when I go back in for more items and I realised I'd forgotten to put the lid on when I filled the kettle. Grabbing at it too hard, I splash hot water onto my hands, scalding my skin, which just makes me swear even more. Back at the window, and I slowly pour the hot water down onto the upturned faces, watching as the water sizzles onto bare skin, sending small clouds of steam up, which is absolutely no effect, other than washing some of the blood from them. Boiling hot water, straight onto them, and no effect. Maybe it cools by a few degrees as it falls, but still, it would have scalded them badly. In desperation, I raise the kettle above my head and throw it down as hard as I can. It strikes with a loud whack, and another body drops out of sight. Yeah, that's better. Much better. Blunt trauma beats hot water. I take a heavy ceramic pot from the pile and throw it down hard. It strikes a shoulder and the impact is enough to make the body stumble. The press of bodies causes it to lose its footing and it's gone from view, trampled underfoot as the space is quickly filled. A frying pan is next and I launch it down. It hits one on the head but bounces off with a metallic dong. No damage. I grab items quickly and take my shots. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. I've never been in a fight. Never caused physical injury to another person before in my life, but I am now. I'm slamming everything I can find down and watching as they impact on the heads of the undead beneath me. Some shots are good. The toaster was great, nice and heavy and straight onto the bald head of a man. He goes straight down, but again, the space is quickly filled. I keep going, fury and anger driving me to scream abuse at the ragged faces. Within minutes... My pile is diminished. I'm breathing hard from the exertion. The front of the house is littered with household objects, and I can see some bodies lying about. But there is still a large crowd of them pushing forward. There are more loud bangs coming from my front door, sporadic and not aimed, but determined. It won't take long before the door is forced by the sheer press of bodies. The barricade will slow them down, but only for a short time. My bedroom looks out over the front. The kitchen and bathroom are at the back. They've both got windows, but both are far too small to climb through. I search for anything left to throw. My gaze falls onto the gas hobs, and I think about the hot water. Then I remember reading books about medieval times when they poured hot oil from castles onto the invaders. Finding a bottle of vegetable oil in the cupboard gives me a small sense of victory before I realise all my saucepans are now in the front garden. I have nothing left to use to heat the oil. My microwave is still there, but I have no pots or bowls. I think of throwing the microwave, but I know it's useless now. It might drop two at best, but that still leaves lots more. A sense of doom comes over me as I head back into the lounge and over to the window. My lighter is still in the corner of the sill, taunting me. I gave up smoking a few weeks ago as I was getting hard looks from the senior managers every time I popped out for a smoke. Jesus, I could do with a smoke right now. I might not have any cigarettes, but I have got alcohol. And maybe that will lessen the horror of what's to come. Strolling slowly into the kitchen, I reach up for the bottle of brandy on top of the fridge and give thanks that I didn't think to grab it in my hunt for missiles. I take the bottle back to the lounge window, watching the undead beneath me as I raise the bottle to my lips. Brandy is flammable, right? So I could use it like a Molotov cocktail. It might burn the house down, but I'm pretty much dead already. It's only a matter of time before they get in. I dash into the bedroom and tear some strips from my pillowcase, stuffing them into the brandy bottle to soak the amber liquid up, then pulling them out. 
I've seen this done in movies and feel confident of how to do it. You light the end and throw the bottle. What could be harder? At the lounge window, I hold the bottle with the brandy-soaked strips of material dangling limply from its mouth. Have some brandy, fuckers. Ooh. My cool and witty one-liner quickly becomes a yelp as the wick flares instantly and bursts into flames. In my panic, I throw the bottle down into the crowd. It hits one on the head and bounces down to roll about unbroken, cushioned by the stupid fat head that it struck on the way down. That's it. My last good idea cocked up. But within a few seconds, I see smoke coming up from the crowd. Then a whooshing noise with flames licking up between the bodies. It's only in a small, confined space, but I can see the black smoke and watch as the flames cause them all to start moving about. The groaning gets louder too, but the press of bodies is so tight they can't move away. A couple of them are on fire now, the flames dancing up as clothing catches alight. This is disgusting. I thought it would be good to watch them burn but it's still a human form on fire and it makes me feel sick. The smell is awful. A mixture of alcohol and burning flesh. I start to gag and move away from the window as thick black smoke billows up into the lounge. I'm coughing and retching, bent over, puking up bile and wiping my mouth with the back of my hand. A faint noise penetrates the sound of my coughing. As it grows stronger, I try and stay still to listen. A car horn. I'm coming closer by the sound of it. Lurching to the window, I try and look out, but the smoke is too much. So I go into the bedroom and pull the curtains down to see an armoured security van in the middle of the road. The van is stationary. But as I open the window, I hear the engine ticking over. The horn sounds out again, loud and clear in the still night air. The bodies jerk round and immediately start staggering towards the van. Here! Over here! I lean out the window, screaming and waving at the van in the road. They continue to break away, charging at the vehicle, which rolls forward a short distance while sounding the horn. The undead move faster, stumbling and jerking after the van. The crowd is thinning. There are a couple of bodies on fire on the ground, and one undead has just caught a light but is still moving away towards the van, which sounds the horn repeatedly and keeps rolling forward. There is a massive crowd of them coming up the road following the security vehicle, and the numbers quickly swell as the things from my house stagger over to join them. The van waits for them to get close, then rolls forward a few more feet. The undead crowd gets close, then the reverse lights come on, and the van goes backward at speed, slamming into the dense crowd, causing a backwards ripple effect into the horde as the front of the crowd loses its forward momentum. Then the van shoots forward again, and continues with the horn. The bodies left mangled on the ground from the van slamming into them are simply trampled by the horde chasing after the van. They are pouring out of my front door and into the road. The van slowly moves away, still sounding the horn, like the pied piper of the undead. I watch as more and more undead file past my house in the wake of the van. The fat man and Laura are with them, but Simon's corpse is left on the path in front of my house. Within minutes, the street has cleared. Chapter 3 I wait at the window, listening to the noise from the van ebbing away. Stunned and silent, the after-effects of the excitement and adrenaline have left me shaken. My hands tremble as I rub my face, reeling from all that has happened. I can't stay here. It isn't safe. They've gone for now but they could come back. My parents live about a 15-minute drive away. I live in Boroughfair, a small coastal town. Brighton is not too far away, and London is a two-hour drive. That's where my sister is. She took a job as a PA for a banking company a few years ago. My parents have a detached house in a nice, quiet area. They always go to bed early, and I know they lock their doors, so maybe they're okay. My mind is made up. I'll head across town to my parents' house. I look at my watch. It's almost 4.30am. Being mid-July, the sun will be up in half an hour or so. I need to get moving while I've got a chance. I don't own a car, 
so unless I can find something to drive, I'll have to walk. In the hallway, I stand staring at the barricade. I don't know if any of them are left out there. I think about removing the barricade, but I'm too scared of what I might find. I go into my bedroom and pull the sheet from the bed. Then another sheet from the airing cupboard, then tie them together with a duvet cover. I go to the window and look outside to make sure it's still clear. The lounge window overlooks the main door, so if I climb out the lounge window, I won't be able to see if they are in the communal hallway. The bedroom window is a few feet away and will give me a chance to run if they come out of the front door. I tie the bedsheet onto the leg of my double bed and drop the sheets down. They reach to a couple of feet above the ground. Weapon. I need a weapon if I'm going out there. In the kitchen, I root through the drawers to find my biggest carving knife with a nice, sharp, pointed blade. I put this into my belt, with the blade resting against my leg. Then an image of me lying on my back with the knife sticking in my leg fills my mind. I need a sheath, but kitchen knives don't have sheaths. I find the small rucksack that I use for work and put the knife into the main compartment, leaving the top open. I try to wedge the knife into the top zip so that the handle is left out, with the blade in the bag. I put the bag on my back, but it hangs down too low. I can't reach the handle. I tighten the straps and raise the bag further up my back so I can reach back with my hand and grasp the handle. In the kitchen drawer, there is a claw hammer, and I put this into my belt. At least I have something that I can use. I think back to the man in boxer shorts hitting them with a baseball bat. He hit them hard and they got knocked away, but they came back. So I know that hitting them won't kill them. But maybe it will buy me a few seconds to run. I go back to the bedroom window and start to climb over the sill, grasping the bedsheets with both hands. I wait, sitting astride the window ledge, listening and looking up and down. No noise, no movement. The night's veil is just starting to lift. Only a few minutes until sunup. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I need to go, but I'm bloody terrified. The final act of leaving the safety of my home is almost too much for me to contemplate. Then I look down at the still smouldering remains of the undead, blood and carnage everywhere. A few bodies are lying still. They must have been the ones I knocked down when the crowd was pushing forward. They've been trampled to death. But then they were already dead. So they've been trampled to death again? What do you call that? How can they be killed twice? I guess that maybe the injuries were too much for the bodies to keep functioning. The spine? It must be that the spine was broken as they went down. Maybe their necks were snapped by all of the undead feet driving down on them. I have to go. Staying here isn't an option. Hesitancy steals over me again. The news said this was everywhere. Shaking my head, I clamber over the ledge until my feet are hanging down. Then I start to lower myself with my hands. I feel extremely vulnerable now, with my legs dangling beneath me. I keep looking around as I lower myself, imagining that one of them will come out of the door and bite my ankle to drag me down to my death. As soon as my feet touch the ground, I move away from the building into the road, the hammer out of my waistband and in my hand. At ground level, I get a close-up view of the frenzied attacks. Bloodstains are everywhere, and a white car is parked just a few feet away with bloody handprints smeared across the bonnet. A crash occurs behind me, and I see one of the undead stagger out from my front door, slipping on the wet blood, but coming straight at me. That's enough for me. I'm off, giving it Billy Big Legs. I glance behind me to see that he's dropping away. As unfit as I am, I am outrunning him as his jerky, uncoordinated motion means he cannot keep up. I keep sprinting until I feel my lungs will burst and my legs are hurting. I slow down and look back, but he's gone from sight. I keep walking fast, sticking to the middle of the road, looking left and right, my ears straining for any noise. The quickest route is straight through town and down the high street, then off onto the main road. A few minutes later I reach a side street that feeds into the town centre. I edge forward slowly until I reach the building line. The sun is almost up now, as the night sky gradually ebbs away. Birds are singing and seagulls are flying overhead. 
I move cautiously, one step at a time as the high street comes more into view. To the right is clear, but the left isn't, and my heart sinks as I see an enormous crowd of them gathered around the armoured security van that had led them away from my house. The van is in the middle of the road, but I can't see why it stopped. It doesn't look like it crashed. The van is surrounded now. Maybe there were just too many bodies to drive through. I watch as a roof hatch opens and a man climbs out. He stands on the roof of the vehicle, looking down at the crowd of undead as they swarm around him, some raising their arms up like fans at a rock concert. He looks over to me, and I stand still, unsure of what to do. Run! He shouts at me. I take a step forward, and he shakes his head. No! Run! Run now! I don't know what to do. He saved my life, but he's trapped now, and I can't get to him. I can't just leave him to his death. The man is still shouting at me to run, and his voice is loud but calm, his movements steady and controlled. How can he be so calm? Looking around, I'm frantically trying to see something that will give me inspiration. Maybe I could get a vehicle and do the same as he did? Lure them away with the sound of a horn? I look back at the van and can see that there are hundreds of the things surrounding him, spread out in a wide circle, all pushing forward. The man is high up on the top. If the undead at the front get trampled down, that will give height to the next row as they push forward. I must hurry. There are a few vehicles parked up nearby and I move towards them, keeping to the building line, my movements slow and guarded. I get to the closest car, but it's locked and secure. This is the town centre, and no one in their right mind would leave a car unlocked here. I check other cars nearby, but they're all locked too. The sky is now much lighter. The sun is almost up. Another few minutes and it will be daylight. With a jolt, I see the pizza restaurant further up the road and remember the conversation I had with Fat Bloke just a few hours ago. He was right there, chatting to me like normal as we ordered food dressed in his smart suit and getting ready for a few drinks. The images of his torn flesh flood through my mind, of the blood loss, the arteries opened up, of the horrific noises they made. I just watched people being killed right in front of me. Hell, I probably just killed a few myself with that bottle of brandy. The pizza delivery moped is lying on its side outside the building the distinctive white delivery box on the back. Before I know what I'm doing, I'm running over and wrenching the thing upright, wincing at the sticky blood on the handles. With the moped up, I turn it around to face the undead crowd. This is an old-style twist-and-go moped. It has no gears to keep it simple for the students and teenagers who use it to earn a few extra quid. Thank fuck the key is still in the ignition. The bike is wheeled out into the road. The van is a few hundred metres away, and I wave at the man standing on the top. I try to point at the moped and gesture that I'll drive away and try to get them to follow me. He shouts back and waves, maybe trying to tell me something, but the distance is too great to hear the words. I get on the moped and turn the keys to the off position, then back on. Pressing the start button, the moped splutters noisily to life. The loud noise from the exhaust is so familiar to me from all of the times I have had takeaway delivered and heard the moped come up the street. As the sun rises and daylight fills the street, I look back to the things, expecting them to be already coming for me. My hand is on the rubber grip, ready to twist and pull away. Something is different. The outer ring of undead have turned and have started towards me, but they're moving slower, much slower shambling and dragging their feet in an awkward shuffle, barely at a walking pace. They were fast before. Not quite at running speed, but they moved quickly and with purpose, like predators after prey, relentless and sustained. Now they're stumbling, as if they're walking through deep water, each step a struggle. I look all about, fearing some kind of trap, but they're all the same. Some are turning and heading my way, others remain standing around the van, whereas before they had a menacing aura and an evil fast motion that was fueled by a hunger for human flesh, now they're a stumbling mess. 
The steps they take are thudding with straight legs and arms hanging limp with heads lolling about. They keep knocking into each other, bumping away and going off course, seemingly unable to follow a straight path. The man is still standing on top of the van. I raise my arm to him, palm up. The international signal for... What the fuck? He raises two arms, palms up. The international signal for... Fuck knows. Then starts doing something else, waving and gesturing, but I can't get what he means. The things aren't growling like they were, but they're still groaning like a deep, rumbling noise that still fills the air. I step off the moped and push the stand down with my foot, leaning the bike over to rest in situ, engine still running and ready to go. Taking a couple of tentative steps towards the mass crowd of undead, I watch them move and shuffle. What's happened? Why have they changed? Just a few moments ago, they were frenzied and savage. The crowd is still too thick to attempt a rescue. There are hundreds of them. About half are now turned in my direction. The rest are still surrounding the van. I go back to the moped and press the horn. A feeble warble sounds out. But I keep my finger pressed down on the button. This appears to focus the direction of their stumbling, and I notice more of the crowd turn away from the van towards my direction. I keep pressing the horn and twist the accelerator grip, thinking that I will rev the engine, forgetting the bloody thing is twist and go. The moped shoots forward, pulling me along. In my panic, I twist the grip more and the moped pulls away faster with me still hanging on. The kickstand bangs into the road surface, propelling the moped off to the right. I slip and fall over. The moped veers off for a short distance before crashing into a parked car with a loud bang. I hear the tinkling of glass as the headlamp is smashed. The moped clunks down to the ground, engine spluttering for a few seconds before it dies out. Still on my ass, I twist round to see the horde is still shuffling slowly. The man on the van is standing with one hand covering his face, and even from this distance I can see him shaking his head. I'm okay, I call out while grinning like a bloody fool. I hope he can't see my face burning with embarrassment. I run over to the moped and lift it up again. It starts first time, and I wheel it back into the road, pressing the horn and waiting until they get closer. There is one undead out front, maybe twenty years old, still in his designer jeans with his t-shirt muscles bulging from his tight top, and all his hair gelled up in the middle in that messy on purpose style that I hate. At least his face has improved with a massive ragged hole where his pouty sneer would have been. A torn, ragged wound in his cheek flaps open to show rows of teeth, and there's dark red blood all over the front of his once white t-shirt and down his arms. There is also a dark stain across the crotch of his blue jeans, but it doesn't look like blood. He must have pissed himself when they got him, which makes me feel better. I was terrified, but at least I didn't wet myself. I'm not much older than him, but I've always hated the weekend town centre crowds, preening, strutting fuckwits. My hair is curly and always messy, without the need for gels and sprays. I think back to the times when I'd been out in the town at weekends, getting barged into by idiots like this who flared up with their arms puffed out while shouting, What? Do you want some, do you? Or texting away on Facebook. I've always worked. Maybe it isn't the best job, but I've held it down and made duty manager, and I know that if I do the hated night shifts, there will be a chance for a promotion. No. There was a chance for a promotion, but that's gone now. It's all gone. Everything has gone. A deep sense of sadness fills me. I'm breathing hard as I think of all my workmates. Most of them were no hopers, but they were an okay bunch. We had a laugh and got on well, shared jokes and wildly exaggerated accounts of women we'd been with or not, as the real case was. I can feel anger building up with the thought of my mates being savaged by monstrous preening pretty boys like this. They were always coming into the supermarket at night, especially after the clubs had kicked out, throwing stuff about and taking the piss out of the staff. I think about Fat Bloke and the life he must have led. Maybe he was deeply sad at his obesity, a reject from society like the rest of us. But he was polite and friendly, always willing to stop and exchange a few pleasantries, and he never looked down his nose at us either. 
I look up and watch the undead pretty boy come towards me and the anger is consuming me. Anger like I have never known before. I can feel my breathing becoming deeper and harder, my heart hammering in my chest. He's only a few feet away now and I watch as he shuffles and groans. He's looking at me and I can see the whites of his eyes are completely red and bloodshot. His skin is very pale and his mouth hangs open with drool dripping down onto his chest. Something in me snaps. A feeling descends with such ferocity it drives my actions without conscious thought and before I know it I've drawn the hammer from my waistband and stepped forward. My arm extends out to the side then sweeps round to slam the hard metal into the side of his head. He goes down and I'm on him instantly, repeatedly pounding the hammer into his head, shattering his face and crushing his skull. My arm is a piston, driving the blunt-ended weapon into his head. Blood and brain matter spray up and coat my arms. My hands become slick and glistening, terror and rage mixing into a deadly cocktail, and all reason is gone. I stop suddenly, becoming alert to my actions. What is left at my feet is not recognisable. The head is pulped, gone, destroyed. I destroyed it. I killed it. I killed the undead. My chest heaves as I struggle for air and stagger backwards. A sudden movement to my right, an undead is there, lunging at me. In reflex, I lash the hammer out in a backswing and connect to the face as it leans in with teeth bared. The force drives the undead off to the side, spinning into a female zombie, a young woman wearing a nice blue dress. She's full-figured with a heaving cleavage and long brown hair, but her face is slack and her eyes are filled with blood. Spittle hangs down from her once pretty mouth. She staggers toward me, leaning forward from the waist, head straining from the neck, lips now pulled back, ready for the bite. I feel repulsed and step backwards. The mantra in my head, you never hit a woman. I move further away and keep staring at the woman. She appears uninjured, no bite marks or blood on her, until I see the blood stains down her bare legs. A chunk of muscle in her right thigh has been gnawed away. To my left, another young male is coming at me. This one has black tribal tattoos all over his arms and on his neck. I lash out, smacking the hammer into the side of his face, and he goes down. He keeps moving, though, and rolls onto his back before sitting up. As he does so, I strike him again, harder, and I see his head snap to one side as he is flung over. Within seconds, he is on his back and again sitting up. I spin the hammer round so that the claw end is now the weapon. Stepping forward, I drive it down into the top of his skull, cleaving through the bone. The force I use pushes the claw into his skull too hard, and it sticks. I try pulling it out, but all I do is pull him towards me. I put my foot onto his chest and pull harder, and the strength of my pull forces his body into my foot. I stagger backwards and fall down with the hammer left sticking out of the top of his head. I get to my feet and realise how close the crowd is now. Another minute or so, and I will be overwhelmed. Trying to glance through them to the van, but they're too close now. Leaving the hammer stuck in that bloke's head, I stagger backwards and remember the bag on my back. I reach my hand down behind my head, groping about, but I can't feel the knife handle that I left there. I pull the bag from my shoulders as I keep moving in reverse. Every one of them is staring directly at me, hundreds of pairs of red, bloodshot eyes watching my every move. The still air is filled with the sound of their shuffling feet. The sight of Fat Bloke snatches my breath away. He's right there, waddling along with the rest of them as he staggers towards me. Pretty Boy is on the ground right in front of him, yet Fat Bloke goes straight over him, trudging his big feet into the corpse. Fast, conflicting emotions course through me. Just seconds ago I felt an overwhelming sense of shame and guilt at the anger which drove me to kill that thing, yet here he is, one of us, one of the rejects, and he wants to do the same as the others and kill me. My fingers are scrabbling for the zip to the bag's main compartment. I get my hand in and feel the plastic handle and pull the long kitchen knife out. Still moving backwards, I look at the shiny blade, 
then at the mass of undead, then back to the blade. It looks puny and feeble now. Fuck this, I mutter. I'm off, running away as I throw the knife off to one side, then regret the action immediately. I stop and go back, grab the knife and start running again. Towards the end of the street I slow down. I've gained a couple of hundred metres from the horde. The road has inclined very slightly and I step onto a bench to look over the crowd. I can see the top of the armoured van is empty. The man has gone. I scan about for a few seconds but I can't see him. There is just a mass of undead on a slow march like a zombie protest through the town. I keep moving, and after a few minutes, I see a mountain bike propped up against the wall with no lock. I grab the bike and start pedalling like crazy down the high street and onto the main road, leaving the crowd of undead far behind. Chapter 4 I know it's still very early in the morning, but there would normally be delivery trucks, milkmen, commuters, all slowly emerging as the day wakes up. Now, there is nothing. It's so quiet. One of the pedals starts to squeak with each rotation of the cog, and it's that single noise that keeps me company on the quiet road. I haven't cycled in a long time, and it doesn't take long before my thigh muscles are hurting. Exercise was neglected for too long. My life had consisted of working all night, then sleeping in the day, eating crappy food and drinking too many beers in front of the television. I'm paying for it now, as I feel exhausted and drained. My parents' house is a 15-minute drive away from mine. As I don't have a car, my dad would pick me up or I'd get the bus. How long will it take to cycle to them? I try to work it out. A car going at about 30 miles an hour would take 15 minutes. So if I cycle at 15 miles an hour, it would take me half an hour. I have no idea what speed I'm doing, but it must be at least 15 miles per hour. I try to remember what speed normal walking pace is. I'm sure it was on TV once. I think it was four or five miles per hour. I reckon I'm going much faster than walking pace. My arse hurts, and my legs are on fire, feeling weird and pumped up. I think ahead, trying to choose the route I should take. One takes me through the side streets, residential roads with houses, and the other would take me on the motorway. Cycles are not allowed on motorways, so I'd be breaking the law, whereas the alternative would take me via the houses and all the undead lurking about. I think I'll risk being arrested. In fact, being arrested would be the best thing in the world right now. A nice safe cell in a locked police station. The squeaking pedal and I cycle down the junction and onto the motorway. It's still early, but hot as hell, and the sweat is pouring from my face. I hold the bike steady with one hand while I pull the bottom of my t-shirt up and start wiping the stinging sweat from my eyes and face. A noise from behind. A car engine. Loud and fast. I drop my hand to look back over my shoulder and see a red car coming up behind me, the engine screaming out into the quiet air. I immediately put my hand up and start waving. I'm in the outside lane closest to the middle section, which is the same as the car, and it's coming bloody quickly, so I start to move over towards the middle. The car does the same, so I start swerving back to the outside lane, but again, it changes course. For a second, it feels like the car is aiming for me, but at the last second, it swerves to the side and goes stonking past at such a high speed, the slipstream causes me to wobble. As the vehicle goes past, I catch a glimpse of a woman driving. Then, as it pulls ahead, I see someone in the back seat. But it looks weird, like the passenger is lurching forward to speak to the driver. The car suddenly veers off and strikes the safety barrier with a loud crash. A split-second action, but the whole thing plays out right in front of me. The speed is so great and the angle of impact so hard, it immediately flips the back end up and out, causing the vehicle to roll over and over in the air. The noise is incredible. The first impact is a thudding, awful boom, followed by near-on silence as the vehicle sails for long seconds before crashing back down to earth. Rolling with terrible, wrenching metallic screams, glass imploding, and a whole wheel is shorn off to go bouncing down the road. Debris flies far and wide, and the vehicle scores a long, deep gouge in the tarmac before it comes to rest on its roof. All 
is instantly quiet again, apart from the squeaking of my pedal as I cycle faster towards the wreck. The car was going so fast that it covered a lot of ground in those few seconds, and it takes me a while to reach it, cycling as hard as I can with the wind blowing into my face and flapping the sleeves of my T-shirt. The car is utterly destroyed. The front end is crumpled in, and the remaining front wheel looks buckled. The windows have shattered into thousands of tiny pieces that are now glittering on the road. There is a foul odour of burning rubber mixed with chemicals in the air, and I can smell petrol too. There are liquids coming out of the front of the car and pooling on the ground. As I give a final burst of speed with my ass off the saddle, I hear a loud crunch and feel a sudden loss of pressure from the pedals. The chain snaps audibly and twangs off to snarl into the rear wheel, which causes me to lose control. I am only a few feet away and heading straight towards the car. I apply the brakes and steer to the right to avoid a collision, but the bike hits some of the liquid and the back tyre loses grip causing me to fall off and slide along the debris-strewn road. How is that possible? How is it possible that on an empty motorway I fall off my bike to smash into the only pissing car here? Noises coming from the car snap me back to reality, and I'm up, scrambling to my feet. The vehicle is upside down, with the windows low against the ground and the doors buckled. I drop to my knees and crawl towards the driver's window as a slender arm drops out, the fingers clenching into a fist. Fuck! The movement makes me jump back, fearing one of those undead things is about to come flying out at me. Help! The voice is low and weak, but the word is clearly heard, and I'm down on my stomach, snaking over the broken glass. A woman with blonde hair is upside down, being held in place by the seatbelt, and I can see deflated airbags surrounding her. Despite the almighty state of the vehicle, the modern safety devices have done their job and left her intact and alive from what I can see. Gently, I take hold of her hand. Are you hurt? The touch and sound of my voice snap her head at me, and I can see a normal face, no bloodshot eyes or drooling spittle. Thinking back to my first aid training, I try and remember what should be done now. She could have a neck or spinal injury, so should stay still until the emergency services get here. Only there aren't any emergency services now. No firemen to cut the roof off, and no paramedics to get her onto a spinal board. Fluids are still leaking from the car. Chemicals and the pungent stench of fuel. Can it explode like they do in the movies? I'm going to pull you out, I say gently as I can, but there really isn't any choice. She has to get out of the vehicle. Okay, she replies in a weak, strained voice. Grasping her hand, I start applying pressure, but out of fear of hurting her, I don't pull hard enough. Shit, the seatbelt's still on. The seatbelt. Can you undo it? She looks at me, then slowly turns her head to grope for the clasp. Not yet, I yelp as I shuffle in closer, fearing she will unclasp it now and fall on her head. Trying to get in as close as I can, I lie flat on my back and push my hands up against her shoulders. Okay, do it now. I gasp and hear the click as she pushes the button down. Her face is pale, eyes dazed with shock, and her movements are slow and sluggish, until she drops from the seat onto my head, that is. I'm fully aware she might be badly injured, but I'm also now in a great deal of pain myself from her weight forcing my back into the pokey outbits of the damaged car. Slowly, I manage to ease myself out while manoeuvring her at the same time. With my body free of the wreck and her pressing weight, I twist round onto my front and start pulling her out by the arms. Just having her head out of the vehicle seems to revive her a bit. Just a bit further... I say as she slowly comes out of the mangled window. Okay, keep going, she replies, her voice a little stronger now. Does your back hurt? No, I think I'm okay. Thank God for that. What about the other person? I ask tentatively, thinking the person in the back might not have survived. Gordon, she gasps as her upper body is pulled free. She stares up at me with wild eyes and freezes for a second before letting go with an ear-piercing scream. 
Panicking, I lower her down to the ground as she starts thrashing about violently. My leg! are the only words I can make out in amongst her screams. Dropping down, I edge closer, thinking a shard of metal must be gouging into her skin. Hold still, please, just try and be still. My leg! My fucking leg! Wiggling closer, I try and get a view of the inside, then spot the back of a man's head that is resting in the gap between the seats. He must be alive as the head is moving, rolling left and right with small, precise movements. I think he's alive, I shout, my words trailing off, as I realise the man's head is resting on her ankle, which must have slid up when I tried pulling her out of the partially crushed car. Sick realisation hits at the same time as he lifts his head up to show his mouth dripping with blood from the hole he has bitten into her flesh. With a growl, he tries to wriggle towards me before giving up and sinking his teeth back into her ankle, causing a fresh burst of screams. Fuck! Pushing myself out of the vehicle, I get free and grab her wrists to heave her away. Hold on, I say through gritted teeth. She screams in complete agony, but slides free from the car. With her leg shifted, the man immediately starts writhing towards the gap left by her exit. A quick glimpse shows me that one of his arms has been removed at the shoulder joint, shorn clean off with thick blood pumping out. Even in the midst of such carnage, I can't help but notice the blood flow is nowhere near what I would expect. It falls out in thick globules, rather than pulsing out in a stream. My leg! Oh, fuck! It hurts! Oh, fuck, it hurts! She screams in agony. I look down at her leg. The blood is pouring out from the wound. It looks deep. The bite must be down to the bone. Her legs are very slender and the muscle is well defined. I need to stop the bleeding. But I don't have any bandages. I take the belt off my jeans and start to wrap it around her thigh. We've got to stop the bleeding, I say quickly. Okay, she gasps. Glancing up, I figure that the man inside the car is moving slowly enough to give us time. Wrapping the belt round her thigh, I thread it back through the loop and start cinching it tight as she stares down at the wound and the blood still coming out. I'm bleeding out, she hisses. Pull it! I wrench back on the belt, trying to form a tourniquet, but the muscles in her thighs are too hard. Shit, I'm so sorry. Dropping down again, I loosen the belt and push it further up her thigh, feeling very awkward at seeing her smooth expanse of skin and her knickers. God, I'm, I'm so, so sorry. It's okay, she gasps and hitches her skirt up higher. Do it, just fucking do it. Wrapping the belt around again, I pull on the free end and gradually apply more pressure. I stare down at the pulsing wound, but there is no change. Fucking pull it then, she growls. With a deep breath, I heave with all my strength as she screams out, her hands reaching up to grab at my arms and clawing at me. Harder and harder I pull the belt, and I even get my foot onto her thigh for leverage as I cinch it tighter into her flesh. Almost, I pant and keep going, determined to get enough pressure so the blood stops coming out. If I can stop the blood flow, I can dress the wound and try releasing the tourniquet a bit. Maybe it will clot on its own. Fuck it, I should have signed up for the advanced first aid course. I'm still pulling to keep the belt from loosening, and it takes a while to slowly work the material under to keep it tight. She's gone quiet, and I think she must be gritting her teeth. I slowly ease my grip, and the belt holds in place. She's still bleeding, but it has slowed considerably. I've done it, I say, hoarsely. No response. I twist round to see she has gone quiet like she's asleep. Her hands no longer grip my arms, but lay out to the sides. Hey. Hey. Wake up. I gently move her head, but get no response. Tapping the side of her face, I try and wake her. Still no response. I lower my head so that my ear is next to her mouth, and I can feel very soft breath on my cheek. A groan sounds behind me. The undead male is trying to crawl out of the car, his head is out, and he's wriggling along, stretching his remaining arm out towards us. It takes me a couple of steps, and I'm at the car. I drive my right foot down onto his head. It feels solid, and the jolt goes up through my leg. 
My left hand is holding the car for balance, and I'm stamping down harder and harder. I aim for the neck and feel a crack under my foot. Hobbling back to the woman, I drop down to rest my ear against her mouth. There's no breath this time. Wake up, come on, please wake up, I plead. I put my fingers to her throat, feeling for a pulse, but there's nothing. I try her wrist, no sign of life. I lift her eyelids. I don't know what I'm looking for, but they always do this in the movies. It must be the pupils to see if they dilate. There is no movement, just blank eyes. In desperation, I lower the side of my head to her chest, trying to hear a heartbeat. I stay for a few seconds, attempting to calm my breathing so that I can listen properly. Her hands suddenly reach round and grab me, pulling my head into her chest. Her breasts are squished into the side of my face. She is gripping so tight and I can feel her trying to rise up while trying to pull me down, the equal force preventing her from lifting herself. I try to pull away, but her grip is so strong. Her hand on the back of my head and nails digging into my scalp, clawing at me. I can't get leverage. My left arm is now underneath her, my right arm beating at her. I use my right hand to try and prise her fingers from the back of my head, but they are so strong I can't move them. I can hardly breathe as her breasts push into my mouth and cover my nose. She has rolled onto her side and is trying to curl round. I use my left hand and grope about until I feel her hair. I take a handful and jerk her head back. I pull so hard that her head is snapped back and she instantly straightens and arches her back. I manage to pull back and extract my head from under her vice-like grip. I get my head free and look at her. Her eyes are open and completely bloodshot. The whites replaced with red. Her lips are pulled back and her perfect white teeth are exposed. She rolls over towards me and I jerk backwards, trying to keep out of her reach. Fucking bitch! You fucking bitch! I shout out in sudden anger and fear. I get to my feet and kick her in the face. She's still writhing, and I do it again, pulling back like a footballer, ramming my foot into her nose. I feel the bone crunch and her head snaps back. Terror grips me. I'm in shock from seeing her die and come back, but what came back wasn't the same as the woman that died. My foot slams into her face again and again. She takes a remarkable amount of blows before she finally lays still, blood gushing from her broken nose and soaking her blouse. I stagger away with my hands to my head, deeply in shock. My vision blurs as hot tears sting my eyes. The shorn-off wheel on the ground, the buckled vehicle upside down amongst the glittering shards of glass, and the pooling liquids mixing with the blood from the two dead bodies. The two bodies I killed. That woman was alive in my arms, pleading for me to save her life. She spoke to me and we shared something, maybe only for a few seconds in time, but we shared a connection. Two living people. We have hundreds, sometimes thousands of interactions every day. We speak to people without thinking anything of it. But after everything that's happened since last night and seeing the undead kill people and watching them turn, then seeing the car crash and getting to her while she was still alive, I feel incredibly guilty. She was another human being that needed help. She was alive and spoke to me and I failed. I failed to save her. If I hadn't fallen off that bike, if I'd got up quicker and moved faster, if I'd pulled hard enough the first time, I might have saved her. But I didn't do those things and she died. It's my fault. She looked at me, spoke to me. We made eye contact and I told her that I would help her. The sickening action of kicking her replays in my mind. The image of my foot connecting with her face. This is awful. The most awful thing I have ever done. Every previous sin can be forgotten. Every previous bad act I have perpetrated is erased. Nothing will ever be the same again from this point on. I tried to save her and I failed. But then she came back and was attacking me. The strength in her hands and arms was incredible. She turned and became undead. I had to stop her, didn't I? My mind whirls as I try to make sense of what's happening, justifying the actions to myself, reasoning and rationalising. If I didn't kill her, she could have got me or someone else. But we're in the middle of a motorway with no one else nearby. Who could she have hurt? Did I kill her through defence or was it murder? An act of vengeance carried out through fear and rage. I have to change this thought process. She was not a she when I kicked her. She was an undead. They are all undead.
The woman from earlier on was not a young lady out for the evening, getting excited about wearing her new low-cut blue dress. She was not a she. It was an undead. They all are. The quicker I get that into my head, the safer I will be, and the greater chance for survival I will have. They are all undead. I lower my hands from my head, resolute, changed and hardened. I have killed to survive, and I will do it again if I have to. I admit, there was a part of me that enjoyed the first kill with the hammer. No, not enjoyed, that isn't right, something else. Something primeval. An instinct buried and softened by modern society. This sickens me. But at the same time, it provides comfort. And I walk away without looking back. Chapter 5 After half an hour, I'm still on the motorway. The fields and trees off to both sides slowly giving way as I pass a village. I haven't seen or heard anyone and with the adrenaline wearing off, I feel totally and utterly drained. At walking pace, it would take me ages to reach my parents' house. There's nothing on the motorway that I can use. I should go into the village and find a vehicle, but I can't see a junction anywhere or a turn-off. I'm sure that the next junction is miles up the road near my parents' village. I walk over to the side of the road and clamber over the crash barrier, down a ditch and across into a field. There is a barbed wire fence in a bad state of repair held in place by wooden posts. A few kicks at one of the posts brings it down, the wire sagging low enough so I can step over. After the smooth surface of the motorway, the field is uneven and hard going. It looks to be pasture. I think that's what they call it, the type of land that animals graze on. I realise that I have no idea what different types of land there are or what different crops look like or even if they can be eaten or not. I work in a supermarket, selling produce all day. We get training on certain things so that we can sound convincing to the customer and increase sales, but I can't remember anything useful. The field borders a lane, which I follow into the village. The first few houses are detached and large, but gradually they get closer together until a pavement starts running down both sides. I reach a junction and realise this is the village centre. I've been here a few times before, when the motorway has been closed off, or my dad wanted to take the scenic route. I remember there is a garage workshop at the end of the main road, so there might be cars there in for repair. Moving off, I keep to the middle of the road, looking all around me as I walk. I can see some of the houses have open front doors, which is very creepy. I'm looking left and right and fail to see the massive bloodstains on the pavement and road until I'm walking through it. The road surface is dark, which makes it harder to see the wet and sticky blood. There is a large stain, like someone was brought down here and bled out. There's too much blood to have been just from one person. But then again, the human body has something like eight pints of blood in it. I try to imagine what eight pints of blood poured onto the floor would look like. Probably like that woman back on the motorway. There was action here, and recently too. The blood is hardly dry. A white UPVC door has bright red handprints up high, smearing down into a large bloodstain at the bottom of the doorway. This was a mistake. I should have stayed on the motorway. Up ahead and off to my right is a small selection of shops. I know there is a cafe here that used to serve really nice cream cakes, and there was a newsagent too. The shops on the right are opposite a small village square where we used to park to visit the cake shop. I can't see the square yet, but as I get closer, I get a feeling of impending doom, and as the row of houses on the left end give way to the square, I start to see people standing about. As I get closer, I correct myself. They're not people. They are the undead things. Lots of them, too. I stand completely still. There must be 30 or 40 of them dressed in differing styles of nightwear. Pajamas, nighties, pants, knickers and bras, some are naked, all of them are covered in blood. I can't understand why they are all here, standing in the village square. Maybe they are gathering here from some remaining spark of intelligence drawing them to the heart of the village. I slowly back away, one step at a time, watching for any sign that they have seen me. 
Behind me, I hear glass bottles being knocked over and shattering. I spin round to see an undead male shuffling out of a doorway, kicking the milk bottles with his feet, making them spin off to shatter on the road. This one is only a few doors down from me. If I move quickly, I could get past him. But another of the undead comes out of the house opposite, staggering into the road, heading my way. They are on equal sides of the pavement now, almost like they had planned the ambush. The village square undead have sparked up from hearing the glass shatter and are starting to turn my way. Shit, shit, I murmur quietly. They're still slow moving, shambling with their stiff-legged walk with no sign of the fast things from the night time. I turn and start back, thinking that I can still make it through the middle of the two behind me. But there are more now, emerging from houses further down the road, blocking my escape route. I turn back to the road ahead, but the village square horde are spilling into the road, coming at me. The news agents is just a bit further up. I start running for it, praying that it's open. As I run past the cake shop and the butchers, a quick thought enters my mind of the massive knives and cleavers they would have. But the door is locked, and too solid to force quickly. I run on towards the news agents. The horde is across the road ahead of me, coming from my left, slow moving, and I pass them by a few metres as I reach the shop and bounce off the door. I slam at it again, glancing back to the encroaching horde getting closer by the second. My fists rain blows on the door, pounding away as the panic builds. Shit, come on! I wail at the door. Looking down, I see the word pull, marked clearly on the door in big letters. I yank the door, and thankfully it opens. I stumble through and pull it shut behind me. Slamming the lock in place, I look for bolts, but there are none. Instead, there are two metal hooks meant to hold a bar, but I can't see the bar anywhere. I move away from the door as the undead get to the other side, banging into the glass pane of the door with loud groans. Their twisted, gruesome faces press against the glass, smearing blood and saliva across the pane. Backing away with my eyes fixed on them, I stumble into a shelf full of chocolate bars and sweets, sending some of them to the floor. The sight of them makes me realise how hungry and thirsty I am. I grab a can of Red Bull from the chiller cabinet and start drinking, guzzling the syrupy sweet liquid down quickly before finishing off with a loud belch. Chocolate bars, junk food and bottles of water get stuffed into the bag. The knife is still there and I take it out. It still looks small and puny, but it makes me feel better by holding it. Behind the counter is the cigarette display. All of the supermarkets have been fitted with sliding metal doors now, in a vain attempt by the government to hide cigarettes away. Smaller shops are not covered by the same laws and can still show their wares. I did give up smoking, but hey, I'm surrounded by the undead in a strange shop. My home is destroyed and civilization has fallen. Fuck it, time for a smoke. I take some tobacco and rolling papers. Tailor-made cigarettes are too expensive, so I switched to tobacco some time ago. It was nearly always someone selling duty-free tobacco from their holidays. After smoking roll-ups for so long, I couldn't go back to normal smokes. The taste is disgusting. I open the packet and roll a smoke with my hands, shaking a little. But it's quickly done, and I use a lighter from a display pack on the counter. I inhale deeply and feel the nicotine receptors having a party in my brain. The tobacco and the effects of the energy drink kick in quickly, making me feel light-headed. Swaying a little, I put my hand to the counter and lower my head down until my forehead is resting on the cool countertop. The dizzy spell eases, leaving me with a pleasant buzz. As I open my eyes, I spot a baseball bat wedged under the counter. Thanks very much, I say into the quietness of the shop. I pull the bat out and hold it in both hands. These shops open early and could be easy targets, especially in the dark winter mornings. The smoke from the cigarette in my mouth curls up into my eyes, stinging them. I clench my eyes shut and wait for a few seconds before opening them gently and blinking the tears away. As I focus again, I see an undead standing at the back of the shop, behind a bead curtain that separates the shop from the private area. It's a heavily set bloke with his fat gut straining against the material of his short sleeve shirt, covered in blood from a ragged bite wound in his neck. The undead moves slowly forward through the bead curtain, which rattles loudly. Drool is hanging down from its mouth, and his evil-looking red eyes stare straight at me. I look about for an avenue of escape, but there is none. The front door is the only other way out, and I can see a mass of the undead things standing outside the door and windows. The shopkeeper shuffles forwards, 
his bulk filling the aisle as he heads towards the counter. I stand still and spit the cigarette away to the side, not taking my eyes off him. As he gets closer, I watch his head lolling back and forth and to the sides, but all the time the red, bloodshot eyes stay fixed on me. Then his head hangs down with his chin to his chest, and he looks up at me, menacing and very scary. He walks straight to the counter, and I grasp the baseball bat at the base with two hands and slowly twist my upper body off to the right, raising the bat behind me, ready to strike. We stare into each other's eyes, fixed, unmoving, neither of us blinking, and long seconds go by. His lips peel back to show yellow, uneven teeth. He can just feel the bite. He can visualise sinking his dirty yellow teeth into my flesh. Piss off! I shout, and swing hard, slamming the bat into the side of his head. An almighty swing, and he goes flying off to the side, colliding with the shelving unit. His body crashes into the metal frame, driving it backwards, spilling chocolate bars and sweets all over the floor. The follow-through from my swing brings the bat straight into the side of the till with a thunk. I put the bat down on the counter and pick the heavy till up, yanking it hard to pull the cables free before I raise it above my head and slam it down on the squirming thing as it wrestles with the shelving on the floor. The till smashes into his head, driving in the bones of his cheeks before bouncing off. I move out from the counter with the bat in my hands and step over the now dead undead, moving carefully towards the beaded curtain. Stepping through with my bat raised, I see a small stockroom and a flight of stairs going up. To the back of the stockroom is a door, barred and bolted. I move over to the door and stand listening. There's a dirty, old, wired glass pane. All I can see is a small backyard and a wall a few feet away. There is no movement outside. I pull the bolts back, tug the door open, and peer out into the yard. It has a high brick wall and a wooden gate. I go over to the gate, raise the latch, and lean out to see a small, clear road. Going left will take me towards the garage I was originally heading for, but an idea forms in my mind and I quickly turn back. I close the gate quietly, head into the stockroom, and shut the back door, pushing the bolt into place. With the bat raised and ready, I climb the stairs to the flat above the shop and check the rooms. Once I'm sure it's all clear, I go back down into the shop. I see four cans of lighter fluid on display behind the counter. I take them out into the stockroom where I find another six cans and a large box of matches. Back upstairs, the windows are old sash and already open in this sultry summer weather. Below me are about 50 of the zombies, all gathered at the front of the shop. I have flashbacks to last night when I was trapped and my ham-fisted attempt at making a Molotov cocktail resulted in me puking up. I don't intend to stick around and watch this time. I pull the little plastic spout on the first one, upend the can and squeeze a jet of liquid out onto the crowd below. I try to aim at their faces. They seem excited by the liquid being sprayed on them. They're still very slow moving, but I can hear more groans and noises coming from them. It takes quite a long time to empty each can, leaning out and bending over to prevent any spraying on me or the windowsill. I open the box of matches and pause for a second, hardly believing what I'm about to do. Mass murder at any other time. I strike a match and flick it out, but it expires before it falls a few feet. I try another and the same thing happens. The third time I lean out and brace my feet, ready to pull back in quickly. I extend my arms, strike a match and quickly shove it into the open box, pushing it into the dark heads of the little sticks. The box flares instantly, a bright light and stench of sulphur. I drop the box and pull myself in, ducking down below the window. I hear a whooshing noise as the lighter fluid ignites. I peer out, just a glimpse, before I run. The flames are spreading quickly, leaping from body to body. I remember the sickening smell of burning flesh from last night, and I race down through the building and out into the road. I turn left and start running, bat in hand. Reaching the end of the street, I turn left again, which takes me out onto the main road. I look back down to the shop and see thick black smoke and flames licking at the side of the building. Bodies on fire. 
they're still standing there. Like they haven't the sense or intelligence to move away. Even the ones standing on the outside aren't moving away. They wait at the point they last saw me, ever hopeful to find one more piece of living flesh to bite into. The building has caught light now. Flames are shooting up the side and more smoke plumes into the air. There is an undead female moving across the square, heading towards the flames, and another undead behind her. Further on, past the fire, I can see the undead moving up the street, heading towards the blaze. They are like insects at night, drawn to light. I don't know if it's the action, the movement, the fire, or just the crowd of other undead that draws them. I move away and head towards the garage, thinking about how they seem to follow each other. Last night I watched as they massed at the front of my house and behind my front door. But I was screaming abuse at them from my window, alerting them to my presence. Then the armoured van went past, the horn sounding repeatedly. Was it the noise of the horn that pulled them away, or the already huge stream of undead in its wake? The thoughts give me hope. Maybe I can carry something that will distract them with movement or noise, something I can throw if I get cornered or trapped. There are plenty of children's toys that bounce about with loud noises and flashing lights. I should have kept a can of lighter fluid and matches. I could set one of them on fire, which will draw others to it while I get away. The thought process makes me realise how much I need supplies and weapons. The bat is good. It's longer than the hammer and means I can keep them away from me. A gun would be perfect, but I have no idea where to find one. The only guns in Britain are shotguns. Even a double-barrelled shotgun only gives two shots at a time. But a shotgun is also long and heavy, like a bat. I think of the movies and news reports, of robbers using sawed-off shotguns. That would make them smaller and lighter to carry, but reduces their secondary use as a blunt instrument or ranged weapon. The police have guns. You see them quite a lot these days, armed police with pistols on their belts. They keep the bigger guns locked in armoured boxes in the car. I guess there must be armouries in the police stations. That gives me another thought. Maybe the police are holed up in their stations. If they have weapons and strong buildings, they could remain safely inside. Borough Fair has a police station in the town centre. Maybe I should have gone there first. Ridiculously, I wonder if they would arrest me if I was armed with a gun. Chapter 6 The garage is detached, a sprawling collection of buildings, workshops and lock-ups. To either side of it is wasteland, with old wrecks and pieces of machinery rusting in the scrub. Big, double wooden doors face out onto a hard standing, oil stains on the ground. There is a single fuel pump in the middle, hardly used as the price is always so much cheaper at the supermarkets. There are two cars on the front, an old Vauxhall Cavalier on a jack with the driver's side wheel missing, the other one a silver Nissan Micra. I move slowly over to the Micra, the bat held in my right hand and out to the side. The car is locked, so I head over to the reception door, which is also locked. Looking through the window, there is no sign of movement and the lights are off. I start walking around the edge of the building, looking for an easy entry point. I hope the Micra is in for a service and not a repair. There might be other cars inside that I can use. Round the back there are more doors, old wooden ones with no windows. The few glass panes are filthy and barely offer a glimpse inside. I could force one of the doors open, but I worry about the noise it'll make. At the front again I check the double doors, but they are flush together and well secured. The reception door is the best option, as the top half is a large glass pane. I stand listening for a few seconds. I will have to be quick, smash the glass, get inside and find the keys, then get out and go. I pull the bat back and swing at the glass pane and the door. The glass is toughened and fractures, but stays in place. Another swing and the bat smashes a hole in the glass, but the pane remains in place. The glass is designed to withstand impact and not shatter into pieces. I keep hitting the glass, smashing holes and forcing the bat around to create a hole big enough to climb through. The noise is too much, and it's taking ages to clear the glass, but I keep going, hitting and moving the bat around in circles. The hole is big enough to lean my head through, 
and I check to see if I can unlock the door from the inside. No good. I look about to check for movement. I can see thick, black smoke in the sky above the village. The fire must have caught on the buildings. I keep smacking the glass away until I've cleared a hole big enough to get through. I slip my bag off and put it through the hole. Then I push the bat through. I climb in, which is harder than I thought it would be, as the bottom ledge is too high to step over and I don't want to enter head first. I have to hop my leg in and straddle the bottom of the frame, then shift my weight over to draw my remaining leg in. Within seconds, a loud alarm is sounding, and, looking up, I see a motion sensor attached to the wall. I grab my bag and the bat, look about, and see a small sales counter for fuel payment. Packaged wiper blades, oils and lubricants are on display. I go behind the counter, but there are no keys. I check drawers and cupboards, again, nothing. A door leads into the workshop area, and I go through. It's very dark, as the grimy windows are not letting much light in. I notice light switches on the wall and flick all of them, watching expectantly as fluorescent strips blink on slowly. There are three clear work bays. One has a car jacked up high enough to walk under, the other two are clear. Tool drawers and various machinery are positioned around the outside. There are shiny red sets of sliding metal trays with cool logos on them. Everything seems to have a snap-on sticker on it. There is a small metal key cupboard on the wall, but the door is locked. I search and find a large, flat-headed screwdriver. Taking this back, I force the end into the gap between the metal door and the frame, levering hard to prise the door open. Inside are a few rows of hooks, with various keys hanging down and two sets of car keys on fobs. One of them has the Nissan logo on a metal clasp. I take the keys and head back into reception. The ceaseless, wailing alarm feels like it's penetrating my skull. An adult female undead is leaning through the door, groaning and still trying to walk forward whilst leaning her head and shoulders through the hole. I use the bat and strike downwards on her head. The impact bends her over the frame and I quickly swing upwards, smashing her back out of the door. I peer out to see her lying with her feet by the door and her body stretching away with her head at an unnatural angle, the neck broken with either the force of the blow or the impact from hitting the ground. I start to clamber through, but my rucksack gets caught, so I go back in and take the rucksack off, throw it out and try again. I step down on the leg of the undead, which makes it easier to get out. I move away quickly in case she gets back up. The micro keys don't have a clicker. It's an old car and I have to put the key in the door. I put my bag on the passenger seat and turn the keys in the ignition. The car shoots forwards with a jolt and cuts out. Shows how long it's been since I last drove a car. I try again, keeping my foot down on the clutch this time. The car starts and I pull away. The seat is too far forward and I feel for the handle underneath me and push it back. I drive away from the village, heading in the direction of my parents' house. In the rearview mirror, I can see plumes of black smoke billowing up into the sky. The fire will spread quickly in the warm, dry weather, and I think of all the damage being caused. No fire engines will come racing to the rescue. There is no one to put the blaze out. No police will cordon off the area. No ambulances will ever arrive to treat the wounded and hurt. It will just burn and burn until there is nothing left. I have an uneventful drive to my parents' village. The car radio has buttons for preset radio stations. I press through all of them, but hear nothing. Only silence and the odd burst of static. Don't they have emergency broadcasts telling people to stay in their homes or wait for further instruction? Using the manual tuner, I twist my way through the frequencies until I start to hear the faint hiss and crackle of a transmission. After a few more seconds, the car is filled with the sound of a man speaking a message over and over in calm, measured tones. There are survivors. You are not alone. Do not come to London. We are completely infested. I repeat, do not come to London. If you are in the south, then we advise you to head to the Victorian forts on the south coast. Take whatever supplies you can carry, water, food, medicine and clothing. Stay out of the cities and towns. Head to the forts on the coast.
I keep listening to the deep voice which I find calming and reassuring. There is no sign of panic or distress in the clipped English accent. I try to picture the man recording the message and my mind creates an image of a kempt older man, groomed and sophisticated, with a beard. Definitely a beard. I think of the forts on the south. They are known as Palmerston's Follies. They were constructed in the 1800s to fight off a French invasion that never happened. There are many of them along the coast, old-style batteries that were used for huge cannon and mortar placements. They were positioned to repel ships, but also built to withstand land forces. Some of them have fallen to ruin, but most have been preserved by historical societies. They are all surrounded by high walls and have underground rooms connected by tunnels. I've seen them many times, but never paid much attention. They're just part of the landscape, a forgotten history. The most famous are the three or four big round bastions in the Solent, the stretch of water that separates the mainland from the Isle of Wight. They are amazing feats of engineering, used now as private hotels or left to decay. I start to form a plan in my head. If I can get to my parents, I could send them to the forts and then try to find my sister. She lives in a posh apartment block with secure entry. It was Friday evening, yesterday, when it started, so she would most likely be out at a wine bar or social function. Networking, as she calls it. The message on the radio said that London was infested and not to go there. But I'm not leaving her. If there's a chance that she is holed up at home, then I have to try. Chapter 7 there is a small gathering of the undead outside the shop in my parents' house. Unlike the previous village, this shop is on the main through road and it's a modern large convenience store, more like a mini supermarket. I slow down as I drive past, scared that I will see my dad amongst them. As I go past, I see movement from within the shop. The windows have posters and signs up and I can't see them clearly, but someone is waving at me and I catch a glimpse of another person standing with them my dad could be inside. He might have gone there for his morning newspaper and become trapped with some other survivors. I think about going straight to their house. But if he is inside, I could be too late if I have to come back. I slow the car and look back at the things. Five of them. Three males and two female. One of them looks like a delivery driver, wearing matching blue trousers and jacket. Another is very old, even from here I can see his hunched-over thin frame and wispy grey hair. He's only wearing baggy shorts and a white vest. The shorts are pulled up high and the vest is tucked in. The two women are both late middle-aged and both dressed in sensible trousers. Sensible trousers and sleeveless jackets with pastel-coloured shirts. Dog walkers, early to bed and early to rise. Clean living with dogs that were always perfectly behaved and expertly trained. Fortunately, no zombie dogs that I can see anywhere. The last undead is a young male dressed in jeans and a t-shirt. I watch them move, slow and shuffling, facing into the shop. They're trying to walk ahead, pressing their bodies against the door and windows, banging into each other. I look about, but I can't see any more undead anywhere. If I'm going to do this, I have to be quick. The noise and movement might attract more and I don't want to end up trapped inside too. I leave the car on the road with the engine running and the door open. I take the bat and leave my bag. Then I go back and close the door, as I imagine coming back to an undead sitting in the back seat, waiting for me. Too many movies. As I slam the door, the old male undead turns round to start shuffling towards me straight away. Within seconds they are all turned and moving towards me, like an unspoken message has passed between them. For a second, I think about getting back in the car and leaving the people inside the shop to their fate, but I would never forgive myself if I did that. The undead are still moving slowly, and again I think about last night and how different they are now with their arms hanging down limp at their sides, heads lolling about, walking with straight legs, which accentuates the movement of their upper bodies. I need to separate them as they are too close together for me to risk attacking them. Even with the range of the baseball bat, it would only take one of them to lunge quickly and I could get bitten. I look at the area. The pavement has obstacles. A bike rack, litter bins and a post box. There is a high step down from the pavement to the road. 
These are things which will impede my movements and could cause me to trip or fall, but the road is wide and clear, with no obstructions. Moving off to my right, I lure them into clear ground. I'm choosing my battleground, selecting where to fight, and it feels strange. There is almost a sense of excitement, a weird feeling, like just before the roller coaster moves off. I'm scared, yet exhilarated. The old man is nearest. He saw me first and has the head start. I thought his old age would make him slower and the others would go past him, but they move at roughly the same speed. It appears the undead are not hampered by age or infirmity. Watching the old man come towards me makes me uneasy. He looks very old and frail and there is a large wound on the top of his right shoulder where the flesh has been bitten away. There is blood all down his front, smeared up his neck and on the side of his face. I'm getting the same feeling as I had when the undead girl in the blue dress was in front of me. Attacking a woman or the elderly seems wrong. Then I remember how I felt after the motorway, when that undead woman tried to bite me. I had tried to help her, but she didn't care. They are undead. They are all undead. Get that through your head, Howie. Learn it and move on. I raise the bat up, poised and ready and wait for him to come. He is a few metres in front of the others, red bloodshot eyes glaring at me and saliva hanging down from his mouth. I look again and can see that he has no teeth, just gums. He's pulling his lips back and baring his gummy mouth. I almost laugh out loud. How can he bite anyone? Will he just suck on them like a love bite? He should be carrying a blender to make flesh soup. I almost feel sorry for him and then I see his long fingernails. His old hands look like claws. The strength of that woman at the car was incredible, and he probably has the same strength too. His fingernails look like they could rip flesh open. The infection could still be passed. The humour is gone. Fuck him. I step forward and swing the bat hard into the side of his head, and he goes spinning off to my left. I move to the right, going round the side of the small group of undead as they all turn to follow me. I move back to the left and they all turn again. I move right and again they all move as one, synchronised zombies. Slowly walking backwards, I lead them into the middle of the road before I run around the back of them. They shuffle round to follow me, but they are too uncoordinated and bump into each other. The delivery driver is on the outside, so I dart forward and strike him on his shoulder, sending him spinning into the two dog-walking women, knocking them away and creating space between them. The delivery driver goes down with one of the women, and both of them groan audibly as they start trying to get back up, but hamper their own efforts by constantly pushing each other back down. The old man is still down, and the young lad is closest now. I step out so that I am facing his left side and smash the bat into his face, his nose explodes with a sickening crunch of bones that I can hear above the impact of the bat. He stumbles backwards and falls onto his arse. I hit again, and he goes down onto the ground, but still moves and is insistently trying to rise up. I go behind him so that his head is just in front of me. I then bend over and strike to the side of his head like a golf swing. The impact is hard, and his whole body is jerked round with the force. <sighs> The delivery driver and the woman are separated and are trying to get up. The other dog-walking woman is coming at me, lips pulled back, showing her already yellowing teeth. I aim an uppercut swing to her chin, but miss and fall into her. I drop my shoulder to force her backwards, and straight away, her arms come up to grab at me. She grips my left arm with vice-like fingers that squeeze and lock on. I use the end of the bat to hit the side of her head, but we are too close and I cannot generate enough force. Small, hard jabs, and her nose breaks, her cheeks fracture, skin splits and bleeds, but still she won't bloody let go. Whacking the hell out of her face to prevent her from getting her teeth into me, I try to pull my arm away, but she's gripping too hard. I move backwards, forcing her to stumble after me. Her grip is so strong. I try to wrench my arm away, but she holds it tight. I keep smacking the bat into the side of her head, and my feet hit the old man on the ground. I step away and force the woman to walk into him, tripping her up. She stumbles forward and goes down, but the force of her grip pulls me down too. The delivery driver is at my right. I swing out and strike his chest. I'm half bent down and having to swing up and out to the right, 
The blow knocks him back, but he stays on his feet and comes back at me. I hit down again at the woman and drive her back to the ground, and still she won't fucking let go of my arm. I swing out and, once more, knock the delivery driver backwards. I shuffle the bat out so that I'm holding the end, then pull back and swing down as hard as I can into the back of her head. Then I put my foot onto her arm and pull myself free. Moving away quickly, I smash the delivery driver in the face and he goes down. I hit him again, driving the bat into his skull, beating his head in. The tripped woman who gripped my arm is getting back up again, like some bloody cyborg machine that just refuses to be stopped. This time I go at her, striking hard with multiple whacks until her skull caves in, and I can see bits of her brain spilling out. There is only the one dog walking woman left now. I'm breathing hard, but I'm focused and ready. I look up just as a young Asian man comes up behind the woman and hits her in the head with a cricket bat, knocking her forward towards me, and I quickly swing out and send her back to him. He's ready and hits her from behind, and again she staggers forward. Just fucking die! I yell out in frustration at how bloody tough these women are. We both step in and strike at her and she goes down from our repeated blows. Her head is destroyed, the skull imploding under the blows, brain matter, blood and tissue bursting out over our feet. I stop hitting and step back, checking that they are all down. Then I look at the young man still hitting her with the cricket bat. I think she's finished, mate, I say to him. Mate, she's definitely finished. Or just carry on. I add as he unleashes a barrage of blows on the extremely dead zombie. Eventually he stops and steps backwards, holding the bat with both hands down at his front, blood all over his shiny white trainers. He looks young, no more than 15 years old. He's dark-skinned with black gelled hair, Indian or Pakistani, maybe Sri Lankan, but his eyes are blazing from the kill. Behind him, the shop door opens and an older woman comes running out, angrily yelling at the boy. What did you do that for? I told you to stay inside. The boy just stares down at the mangled body beneath him. He doesn't react as his mother stands next to him, shouting. She gets no sign that he is listening and tries to pull the bat away from him. Feeling that motion, he becomes alert and steps away from her, pulling the bat from her grasp. He was trying to help us. We couldn't just leave him on his own. He could have been killed. His tone is angered but squeaky and high-pitched, showing his age. No, you could have been killed, you foolish boy. And don't talk back to me. Don't you ever talk back to me, she shouts back at him. She switches into a language that I cannot understand, speaking quicker to the boy. He finally hangs his head with a look of shame and starts back towards the shop. The woman stays and looks at me, and when she speaks, her tone is polite. Thank you for what you did. I am sorry for my son. He is young and foolish. She looks about at the bodies, the blood stains on the road, the woman's brains beaten out of her head, but she shows no emotion or reaction. You don't have to be sorry. He was just trying to help. He was very brave to do that. You really shouldn't be angry at him, I say to her. Please do not tell me what I should or should not do with my son, she snaps back. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. I can't believe what's happened. What's happening? This is just so... My voice trails off. Have you seen more of them? We tried calling the police, but we cannot get through. 999 is not working. We cannot get hold of anyone. They're everywhere. I'm from Borough Fair and the whole town is gone. I went through Littleton on the way here and that's gone too. Oh, oh my. She puts her hand to her cheek. I was watching the news on television last night. It's all over Europe, I say gently. Her mouth hangs open. The shock is visible on her face. She stays silent. I'm, uh, looking for my dad, Howard. He comes down every morning for a newspaper. Have you seen him? She stays silent for a few seconds. I'm sorry, what what did you say? She looks back at me with a confused expression. 
My dad, Howard, he comes down every morning for a newspaper. Have you seen him today? I repeat. Oh, Howard, yes, we know Howard, always so polite. No, we have not seen him. There's just my family, uh, my son and daughter, and me, of course. Is your husband not with you? No, he is visiting family at home. Her voice becomes very soft. I'm sure he is okay. Maybe it's just Europe that's affected. If he is somewhere else, he might be safe. I try to reassure her. He is in India. Look, why don't you go inside? It's not safe out here in the open. Yes. Do you want to come in? No, thank you. I have to go to my parents' house. They live on the estate. Listen, I heard a broadcast on the radio. It said that people should go to the forts. What forts? The old ones, the Palmerston forts. There's quite a few of them all along the coast. The radio said London was infested and people should head over to the forts and take food, water and medicine. Oh, I think we should stay here and wait for help. We have enough food, thank you. I don't think it will be safe here. Those things are everywhere. I point at the bodies on the ground. And other people might want to take your food. Maybe you should take what you can carry and go to the forts. Do you have a vehicle? We have a van. My husband uses it for the cash and carry. Take your van, load it up with as much as you can take, and then leave, I urge her. What about my husband? What if he comes back and cannot find us? Leave a note for him, and also one that tells other people where you have gone so they can go there too, but do it quickly. She glances back at the shop, clearly unsure of what to do. I can see her dilemma. The shop looks strong and secure, a safe place. I saw these things last night. They were different. They weren't slow like these were. They were fast. If they change again, they won't stop until they have got you and your family. She stares back at me. The suggestion of a threat to her family has sharpened her instincts for survival. Where are these forts? Check the internet, if it's still working. If not, look at local maps. They're tourist attractions and will be marked. Do you sell maps? Yes, yes, we have maps. Check them and find the nearest fort, then load up and go. Please don't stay here, it's not safe. Okay, okay, we will go. Food, water, medicine, she repeats back to me. Take what you can get into the van quickly. Water, tinned food, any medicine, aspirin, paracetamol, anything. Take clothing too, but please be quick. She goes to move away, then hesitates. Will you come? We could uh, travel together? She asks me. I can't. I'm sorry. I have to find my family. I will try and get my parents to follow you. I'll ask them to come here first and see if you're still here. But don't wait for them. Load up and get going. She nods and walks back to the shop, still in shock. I'm worried that she's not taken it in and will try to wait it out. Her son comes out of the door, walking towards his mother. A teenage girl comes out behind him and stands back, holding the door open. Hey, thanks for your help again, mate. I just said to your mother that people are going to the forts on the coast. She said you have a van. I really think you should load up with food and water and go there as soon as possible. Take anything you can carry. Are you going there too? His mother interrupts before I can answer. No, he has to find his family. Go back inside, please. I turn and walk to the car. The bottom of my bat is covered in blood and bits of gore that smears across the seat as I get in. My parents moved here a few years ago. The old house was the family home. This is their new house, and it feels different. Still homely and welcoming, but not the same. My dad retired two years ago. He was an engineer for a telecoms company and had a good retirement package, but he quickly got bored of playing golf and went back as a part-timer. My sister and I bought him a new set of clubs for his 60th birthday. Well, I say we bought them. My sister paid most of it as she earns a fortune. I paid what I could, but still, it's the thought that counts. Their new house is detached and modern, but the large driveway is empty. Dad bought a new Toyota when he retired and always leaves it on the driveway, proudly, cleaning it at every opportunity. I leave the micro on the street, engine off, but keys in the ignition. 
ready to go. I walk towards the house. The front door is closed, and all the windows are shut. There is a gate to the rear garden, but it's locked and too high to climb. The front door has been left unlocked, and I enter. Pausing for a minute in the hallway, eyeing the stairs ahead of me. The hallway leads to the kitchen. To the left is the lounge with the door open. The dining room is to my right. There is no sound, and I close the front door gently behind me. I want to call out, but don't want to risk alerting any undead that I'm here. I go into the lounge, and then the dining room, and finally the kitchen. There are two half-drunk mugs of coffee on the side. Both are cold. I go upstairs with my bat raised, but find nothing in the two guest rooms. The bathroom is clear. My parents' bedroom is also vacant. The drawers are empty and thrown around and the wardrobe is open. There are clothes lying about. It looks like they were in a rush, so they must be aware of what's happening. I go back downstairs and check the rooms again. There is an open notepad on the dining room table with a handwritten note in my mother's writing. Howie. Dad got a phone call last night from an old colleague working in France. They said what was happening. Awful things. Dad spoke to your sister. Sarah is safe at home, locked in and secure. The phone line went down when we were talking to her. We kept trying to call you, but all the numbers were engaged. We're going to come and get you. But I suppose if you're reading this, then we've missed each other. Stay here, Howie. We will try your place and come back here before we get Sarah. We left the front door unlocked in case you left your key behind. You can lock the door, though. We both have our keys. Please stay here, Howie. We'll be back soon. Love, Mum and Dad. I read the note over a few times. Sarah is safe, thank God. The relief is massive. I know they will come back here before they do anything. I feel so weary now, hungry and exhausted. In the kitchen, I find a Cornish pasty in the fridge and wolf it down within seconds, followed by another. I make a mug of tea, as the electricity and gas are still on. I try the home phone but find it dead. There's not even a dial tone. I check the router, lights flashing red, no internet and no phone line. After locking the front door, I go upstairs to the bathroom. I'm filthy and covered in blood, gore and dirt. My hands are bloodstained, with black crusty grime under the nails. I strip off and have a hot shower, wondering how long it'll be before the power goes off. Might as well take the opportunity now. I soak and scrub myself. The water runs red at first and I keep scrubbing until the filth is washed away. My clothes are too dirty to put back on, but my dad is much bigger build than me and I know that his clothes won't fit. These clothes need to be thrown away. The blood could be infectious, but then I would have nothing to wear. I remember that there are some old clothes of mine in bin liners in the loft. I'd left them at the old house and mum kept nagging me to go and sort them out, which I never did. I wrap a towel round my waist and find the long stick to open the loft hatch in my parents' room. The latch opens downwards and a folding metal ladder extends down. I climb into the loft and turn the light on. The loft is boarded out and I can see a pile of black bags with sticky white labels marked Howie on them. I find an old pair of faded blue jeans. I used to live in these years ago. At first, I grab a plain white t-shirt, and then I figure out that the white colour won't blend in too well, and so I keep looking through the bag until I find an old black v-neck jumper. I check that the jeans still fit. They're a little tight round the waist, but they'll have to do. Finally, with nothing left to do but wait, I go into the lounge and lay down on the sofa, thinking through all that has happened. Within seconds, my eyes are heavy, and my breathing has slowed. I jerk awake a couple of times, my body twitching, but eventually I drift off to sleep. Day 2 Saturday Chapter 8 Waking up slowly, I drift back to consciousness, stretching out lazily, arching my back and pushing my arms away from me. The sofa is lovely and soft, and I can feel myself getting ready to fall back into slumber. 
I've always loved dozing in the afternoon with the sound of the television low in the background. It's the reward of modern society, to relax and snooze in the safety of your lounge. But there is no modern society left, and the safety is gone. The events of yesterday come flashing back to me, sharp in my mind. The sound of the undead groaning at my front door, the fear as they lunge forward, teeth bared, and the smell of human flesh as it burns. The smell is so real I feel nauseous, and I have to run to the kitchen sink to spit up. Slowly my mind settles and I begin to think more cohesively. I think of everything that has happened and try to imagine what the future will be like. Has this epidemic spread across the world? The news reports were only talking about Europe. Maybe America and the other continents are safe. Europe is small in comparison to the others. I try to imagine a world map. Europe is joined to Russia, which is joined to Asia and other places I don't know the names of. If the infestations spread across Europe so quickly, surely other places would be affected. Maybe some islands have been able to prevent entry to people and kept themselves safe. There must be some safe places. The Americans have strategic policies for everything. They would have initiated some lockdown protocol. But then all the movies show the top brass going to underground facilities while the masses suffer, and some handsome underdog hero that everyone said would never make the grade somehow saves the day and gets the girl. A sudden thought hits me. If the problem is restricted to Europe, the other countries wouldn't allow it to spread. They would try to destroy it, and destroy us in the process. Nuclear bombs would be sent into every major capital and city. We would be annihilated. But if places outside Europe are infected too, there is no hope. We are fucked either way. With my mind whirring so quickly after waking up, I focus on something mundane and twist the tap to pour a glass of cool water, which I lift to my mouth and take big, refreshing gulps. An image of rotting, undead corpses floating in reservoirs infecting the water supply swims nicely across the front of my mind, which causes me to spray the contents of my mouth out all over the window in front of me. How does the water supply work? I have no idea. You turn the tap on, and water comes out, but where does it come from? The water is treated, so there must be treatment places where they add chemicals. There was something in the news years ago about water companies adding fluoride to the supply, but I don't remember why that was a bad thing. How easy would it be to infect the water supply? I stare at the remaining contents of the glass. The water looks normal. It's clear, and there's no noxious smell or odour. I didn't taste anything foul when I first drank it, but the thought is there now. Maybe if I boiled the water, that would make it safe. What would Ray Mears do? He would use earwax and moss and make a slingshot from cow turds before building a treehouse city and living like a demigod. I wonder what Ray Mears is doing now. Has he survived? It would be ironic if the television survival experts were now also undead, roaming around Welsh valleys biting sheep. The water I spat out is dripping down from the window, but at least it's still light outside. I check my watch. 9pm. I slept for hours. It must have been midday, or maybe 1pm, when I finally lay down on the sofa. My parents should have been back hours ago. Where are they? I go into the lounge and check the router. Still red flashing lights. No phone line. In my panic, I left my mobile phone at my house. Not that it would work now, anyway. They said to stay here and wait, but that was hours ago. It would only have taken them an hour, at the most, to get to Borough Fair and back. I think back to the massive horde of undead in Borough Fair town centre. If my parents had driven anywhere near that place, they could easily have become overwhelmed. I hope that my dad would have the sense to avoid going there. I should wait here. But if they're not back by now, then something must have happened. I head into the dining room and write a note, telling my parents that I waited until 9pm, and that I'm going to check Borough Fair, then I will come back here. I tell them to lock up and stay safe. Heading towards the door, and another thought strikes me. Rushing back, I add a quick PS to the note. Don't drink the water, boil it first, 
Think like Ray Mears. My bag is still in the micro, but I did bring the bat inside with me, the end of which is filthy with crusted blood and bits of dried gore. I go back to the kitchen and start running it under the tap. What am I doing? Who cares if the bat is dirty? I start towards the front door, then stop and go back to the kitchen and out into the garden, looking round for any other weapons I could use. I don't want to use knives, as their range is too short, unless I could find a sword, but swords are not exactly a household item. Nothing obvious in the garden apart from a wooden bench and a clothesline, neither of which would make particularly good weapons, unless your aim is, of course. I open the back door to the garage and step in. Dad is an engineer, and I know he has loads of tools all hung up in properly marked slots, everything neat and tidy. There are gardening tools, hoes and shears. The shears are good, but again the range too short. I want something long to keep them away. A garden fork? But it would get impaled easily and stick in the body. A metal spade? No, it lacks the striking power. Then I see an axe hanging from the head and a plastic cover over the metal end. The handle is longer than the bat, tough plastic with a rubber grip. I take it from the hook and pull the plastic cover off. The metal end is shiny, unused. The blade looks sharp. Not sharp enough to cut my finger when I press gently, but I can imagine the damage that it could do. The other side of the metal head is squared off, a perfect blunt instrument. As soon as I pick the axe up, I know that I've got to have it. It's heavier than the bat and it feels far more substantial, the heavy head makes the axe more lethal and it feels much more like an extension of my arm than the wooden bat does. I should ditch the bat, but it has proven to be a very good weapon and I feel reluctant to lose it. Maybe I could use both. In the garden, I practice swinging both at the same time, fending off imaginary undead zombie things. My swings get more and more wild and in the end I'm just spinning round trying to stop my arms from being pulled off. Eventually. The axe and the bat end up clashing together and the resulting crash leaves me sprawled in a heap with both arms aching. Feeling clumsy and awkward, I stagger to my feet, silently thanking that no one was around to witness my incredible display of stupidity. Deciding I can't delay any longer, I leave the bat in the hallway by the front door and step outside into a lovely warm summer evening to see some bastard has taken the micro. Fucking apocalypse is here and some shit steals the crappiest car possible. Looking up and down in case it rolled away or I left it further up, but nope. Definitely not here. I end up doing that thing that everyone does in these situations and standing there for a few minutes looking all around in case it should magically reappear. Walking out of the estate and I notice that the driveways of the other houses are now all empty. Most of these had cars on them when I got here earlier. Well, that explains why someone stooped so low as to steal a Nissan Micra instead of a nice BMW or Mercedes. It takes me several minutes to get down onto the main road where I aim towards the shop, hoping there will be something I can use. It's still light, but that won't last more than an hour or so. The shop comes into view and I can see my Micra is parked amongst the other cars, looking small against BMWs, Mercedes and Range Rovers from the posh retirement estate. The fact that it isn't actually my Micra is not relevant. Whoever stole it doesn't know I stole it first. As I'm trying the handle of the Micra, a man steps out from the shop, which makes me start guiltily like I'm trying to steal a car. Can I help you? He asks in a polite but firm voice. An older man, maybe in his fifties, dark hair, greying and swept back. He looks refined and cultured. Hi, this is my car. I point at the Micra. Oh, I see. Well, I'm sure there must be some misunderstanding. More men come out from the shop. They gather behind the older man, a collection of weapons held in their hands, knives, bats, metal poles. Another man steps out from behind the crowd. A double-barrelled shotgun rests across the crook of his arms. This is clearly a deliberate act to show me he is armed. The group try to look menacing with stern faces, 
but they're all slightly overweight retired accountants and bankers with greying hair and wearing a collection of golfing trousers. What's going on? Why are you all here? I keep my tone polite. Ah, well, you see, there is food here. Uh, food and supplies, and, well, we thought we would take care of it and keep it secure, if you like, until the authorities can get a grip on this uh, situation. He pauses. Of course, you are welcome to join us. Thank you, I uh, appreciate that, but I'm heading to Borough A deep voice from the back rumbles out. Borough has gone, mate. Yeah, I know. I was there at the time. May I ask what happened to the family that owns this shop? A woman and her two children? Ah, I see. Yes, no sign of them, I'm afraid. We came down from the estate a few hours ago. Well, the ones that are left did, anyway. We got together and decided to make our base here, because there's plenty of supplies, and it's on the main road, and uh, all that. He speaks with a clipped, almost military manner, nodding while he talks. OK, they must have gone then. Did you see a note? They said they would leave a note saying where they were going. Ah, yes, there is a note, but it's not in English, you see. None of us could... Uh, well, we couldn't read it. That makes sense. I nod back at the group. Did any of you hear the radio message about the forts? Looks pass between them, a sudden interest and I can see they're all looking at me keenly. Some of the men from the back move closer. The forts? What forts are those? We haven't heard any radio message. Was it an emergency broadcast? We've been scanning the medium and long wave frequencies, but not heard a thing. I relay the message I heard on the radio saying that London is gone, and people should head to the Palmerston forts. Ah, I see. Right, well, there we go, eh, chaps? The British government has a plan. Did they say which fort precisely? No, just that. The micro had it on the radio earlier. Didn't the person who stole, uh, who took it, hear the message? He starts looking at the men gathered around him. Who brought the micro? Nigel, was it you? No, must have been Malcolm then. His car was in the garage for a service. Malcolm, where are you? Another man pushes through the crowd, thin build, glasses and floppy blonde hair. He looks sheepish. Sorry about your car, he says. I thought it had been abandoned. Yeah, from right outside my house. Well, my parents' house, anyway. That's OK, mate. Did you hear the message on the radio? No, but I only drove it here. It might still be on. Have you got the keys? There are survivors. You are not alone. Do not come to London. We are completely infested. I repeat, do not come to London. If you're in the south, then we advise you head to the Victorian forts on the south coast. Take whatever supplies you can carry, water, food, medicine and clothing. Stay out of the cities and towns. Head to the forts on the coast. I turn the volume up loud. There is an instant reaction as the men gather closer round the front of the car, and then more come out of the shop, women and children. People are shouting for everyone to shush and be quiet. They all stand silently, listening to the message. One of the men leans in to look at the front of the radio, the FM frequency setting, and rushes back into the shop. As one, they start talking and moving about quickly, a sudden need for action and the hope of a safe place to go. Ah, now hang on, chaps, hang on a minute. We need to organise ourselves and gather supplies, plan our route and travel in a convoy. The spokesman is shouting as they rush off. They disperse quickly, heading back into the shop, and I'm instantly forgotten. It's just me, the micro, and the keys in my hand. I drop the axe into the passenger side. My bag is gone, but at least I have the car. I start the engine and reverse out onto the main road, Pulling away, I see the spokesman stop and look back. He holds his arm up in farewell as I speed off down the road. Chapter 9 The motorway is the fastest route. The daylight is starting to dwindle, and I need to move quickly. The radio message is annoying now, and I turn it down, but not off, just in case something changes. 
On the same motorway as earlier, and within a short time, I see the wreck and the two bodies lying by the mangled car. I keep my speed up and get past quickly. A few minutes later, and I take the junction that heads into my town. Habit of hand kicks in, and I put the indicator on at the 300-yard sign. I come off the motorway and drive towards town, trying to think of my route. I need to get to my place, but avoid the town centre. I hope that Dad would have thought this too and taken the longer road. With any luck, I'll be following in his wake. I skirt round the town and drive towards my flat through suburban streets. There are signs of devastation everywhere. Abandoned cars with doors open, glass on the road, front doors hanging open and windows smashed. What shocks me the most is just how much blood there is everywhere. It's smeared over car doors, splattered against windows, and in some places, just pulled in puddles. I spot a trail of it leading down a garden path. Thinking back to the undead crawling along my road yesterday, slowly pulling out their intestines bit by bit. It's all I can do not to be sick again. No people, though, and no bodies. Driving along, I see movement outside a house. Shuffling into view is a child undead in teddy bear pyjamas, dripping with blood. He senses me and his blood-red eyes turn in my direction as he starts to follow the car. Shuddering, I accelerate, desperate to find my parents. I get to my road and pull up outside my house. The bodies I set on fire last night are still there, burnt and blackened, and the contents of my flat are still strewn across the front garden. The scene looks surreal. Like someone has created a movie set and carefully placed the objects near the dead bodies. My toaster stands out the most. Something about the image upsets me deeply. Memories of making tea and toast when I got home from working nights, tired and looking forward to sleep. The safety and comfort of my home is gone. I think of the news reports of faraway places suffering from war or natural disaster, refugees giving accounts on losing everything and how they can never go back. I felt sad for them, but no real empathy. How could I? We live like kings with everything we could ever need or want. I try to push the thoughts away. This isn't the time to dwell now. I can grieve later when my family is safe. There's no sign of my parents here, and I don't want to go inside and double check. I know they would have seen this devastation and feared the worse. Even if they went inside and checked, they would think that I had gone. So I try to work out what they would do next. Their note said that they would go back to their house but they never arrived. Either they changed their minds, which is unlikely, or something stopped them. The road ahead leads into the town centre, the same route I took last night. If they didn't go back, then they must have gone that way. I have to go and see. Driving forward slowly, I realise that it's almost dark, and I speed up. I really don't want to be out when it's night. I get to the T-junction, and the high street is ahead of me. The right leads down to the roundabout and away from the centre, and the left leads into town and the main shopping area, bars and cafes. The right is clear of undead, but the moped I crashed into the parked car is still there. I look to where the massive horde was last night, but there is no sign of them. The armoured van is still in the middle of the road, and again, I wonder what happened to the driver. I turn left and drive towards the van, stopping next to it. No sign of why it stopped, and I can only guess that it was just the size of the crowd that prevented him from moving on. He should have turned the other way and lured them away from town. I start to drive on, but I get a sudden idea. So I stop, and taking the axe with me, I head over to the van. It's a big, blue, square-looking thing with some symbols on the side and big writing on the back saying, Police follow this van. I can't work out if that's an instruction to the police or if they're telling potential robbers that the police are actually following them. The driver's door is locked, and so is the passenger's. There is no sign of damage to the front of the vehicle. The man climbed out of a roof hatch last night, but the van is too high and the sides too smooth to climb up. I get back in the micro and park it tight alongside the van, then clamber out over the passenger seat and up onto the roof of the car. The hatch is still open, and I can see a grab handle on the inside. Once up, I edge over to look down into the vehicle where I see a black swivel chair. To one side are shelves and compartments, all of them numbered. 
I drop the axe down and then lower myself down onto the chair. Inside, I can see cloth money bags on the various shelves, and each bag has a serial number. At the front of the van is a door leading to the cabin. The door is wedged open with a small red fire extinguisher. There is a numbered code lock on this side of the door, but nothing on the driver's side. I guess the rear passenger has to be able to get out, but there's no need for the driver to get in. How did the driver get through to the back, then? I saw the van being driven, then the man getting out onto the roof. There must have been two of them, or he'd already wedged it open. The keys are still in the ignition. The controls are the same for any normal vehicle. I get into the driver's seat and turn the ignition. The van turns over but doesn't start, but the flashing icon on the dashboard tells me why. He ran out of fuel. Simple, really. Out of the van and back onto the roof of the Micra, the daylight has almost gone now, but I still see the movement from further down the street. There is a single undead coming towards me, wearing black trousers and a black shirt. He is fucking huge. At least six foot four with muscles that bulge out of his forearms and biceps the size of melons, and with the obligatory shaved head and no neck, I figure he must be a bouncer from one of the local clubs. I watch as he shuffles along slowly, his arms hanging limply. As he gets closer, I see that the top of his bald head has been savaged with bloodstains down his face. Shit, I wouldn't want to meet him on a normal day, never mind now. He is still a couple of hundred metres away. I turn to move back to the car, intending to get the hell out of here. The daylight has gone completely and the night has set in. Glancing back, I notice the big fucker has stopped, motionless. His head is slightly raised and not lolling about like it was a few seconds ago. He lifts his head higher and lets out a huge guttural roar. Then I hear others from further up the road. Somewhere nearby, another joins in. They are all emitting a deep, terrifying roar, like wolves signalling each other. My heart is pounding. This is the single most frightening thing I have ever heard. The sound goes on for a while. There must be hundreds joining in now, and the call reverberates down the street, echoing off the buildings. The sound doesn't diminish or die off. It just ends, and the silence that follows is truly deafening. The big bouncer drops his head and stares straight at me, then starts shuffling slowly with that same awkward stiff gait. Within a few strides, that awkwardness goes. He becomes more cohesive and coordinated. With the street lamps illuminating him, I see the transformation on his face too. The slack-jawed look of sublime stupidity is replaced by something evil and very focused. This is like last night when they were wild and frenzied. He's running now, lurching towards me, still jerky but certainly a whole lot more switched on than he was a couple of seconds ago. I turn towards the car and launch myself into the passenger side head first, which is another monumentally stupid thing to do as the car is too small to twist round him properly. He will be at my back within seconds. The axe is still in my hand, but the space is too confined to bring it up. Twisting onto my back, I try to reach the open door to slam it shut, but I'm too slow, and he's through the open gap, driving his head in at me. With a strangled yelp, I get my knees up, and for some obscure reason, I take a split second to stare at the ragged wound on his scalp, where the flesh has bitten down to the bone. The blood is congealed down his face, and his mouth is bloody with his lips pulled back, showing two ugly rows of blood-stained teeth. His red, bloodshot eyes add to his look, which is utterly bloody terrifying. I kick out, frantically trying to keep him away, but it's like kicking a tree. My feet keep going, cycling back and forth, and the soles of my trainers strike him repeatedly in the face. His nose smashes, and his head is constantly jerked back, but he keeps coming at me, gnashing his teeth while snarling like an angry dog. I use both feet at the same time, kicking out with all my strength, and the force is enough to knock him back onto his ass. A frantic, split-second decision. I don't have the time to scrabble up and close the door, so I look round in desperation and see the keys in the ignition. Reaching out, I grab and twist them, and the blessed little micro-engine comes to life, leaning down to push the accelerator, but it's not in gear. 
Trying to do so many things at once and multitasking has never been my strongest skill. Watching the open door while trying to get the stick into gear, but the thing won't slot in without the clutch being pressed down. The bouncer is up and coming at me as I press my right down on the clutch and use my left to push the stick into first while I start kicking out at his big face again. My kicks are panicked and not aimed. I can feel they're connecting, but I'm trying to look at the pedals. If I lift the clutch without power, the car will stall. Fuck it! Just fuck off! I scream in part frustration, part anger and a whole lot of fear. My feet are cycling again. He is pushing in further towards me. Thank God he hasn't thought to use his hands. He could snap me instantly, but an equal force is created that just about holds him at bay. My thighs are burning and my stomach cramps from holding my legs up. I'm leaning over to the right and pushing my left hand down on the clutch. My right hand is free now and I push the gas pedal hard. The engine revs and I can feel the car vibrating. He is almost in the car now and his body weight has trapped my left leg against the side of the vehicle. My right foot is pounding into him. There is a sudden pain in my side from being bent over at such an angle. I lift my left hand up and the engine bites, but there is no motion. The fucking handbrake, the fucking stupid handbrake. I claw away trying to find it. Then my hands grip the end and I push the little button in and feel it drop. The car shoots forward, scraping along the side of the armoured van. The undead is dragged along for a few metres. His massive upper body holds him in the car, then he drops out and is gone. I keep my hand pressed down, hoping to hell that I don't crash into something. I try to raise my head, but I can't stretch high enough, so I wait a few seconds and then pull my hand away. The car splutters and the engine dies. Then it stops. I twist round quickly and look out. I am inches away from a bench, aiming straight at the building line on the right. I pull myself into the driver's seat dragging the axe from underneath me and pushing it into the passenger side. My stomach muscles are in agony and my thighs are burning. My chest heaves as I try to suck in air. I twist the key off and back on, putting my foot down on the clutch and I look in the rearview mirror. The undead is already up and running at me only a few metres away. The bench is trapping me from going forward. I push the gear stick into reverse and thrust the accelerator down. My left hand is on the top of the passenger seat as I twist my torso in order to see out of the back. The car gathers speed as the undead runs at me, and we collide with a massive bang that sends him flying backwards. Fear, adrenaline and rage are within me, and I am out of the car with my axe held in both hands. He is already sitting up, trying to stand, but he struggles and falls back down. His right leg buckles underneath him. I step forward before he can get up, and swing the axe at his head, cleaving his skull open and driving into his brain, splitting his cranium open, which bursts the grey matter out like the yolk from a boiled egg. I pull the axe back and he slumps over to the side, but the anger is coursing through me. Raising the axe above my head, I drive the blade into his neck, severing the spinal column and detaching his head. In victory, I kick it hard and it shoots off a few feet. Cunt, you fucking cunt. That fucking hurt. Hopping about from the stabbing pain in my big toe from kicking his stupid fat steroid head. An undead male comes staggering at me from the left with another one right behind him, only a few paces away, and I have just enough time to lift the axe up, step backwards and strike out. I aim for the head, but miss and strike his neck, splitting it open and sending him away from me, blood pouring out of the wound. No time to change position. The next one is already charging in, so I swing the axe backwards and use the blunt end to crush his skull. He goes down from the blow, and I hit down at him, pulverising his head. The other one is still down, with a gaping slash in his neck. He's twitching, but not getting up. There are more coming, following the path that I just took. The noise and action must be drawing them. I get back into the car and drive on, squinting through the fractured and filthy windscreen. Ahead of me is the narrow, older part of the high street. A large metal drop barrier is used during the evenings to stop vehicles going in, making it pedestrian only. There are numerous cafes with outside seating and shiny metallic seats complete with small round black tables desperately trying to bring a European feel to the area. 
At night, the cafes shut and the bars put their outside seating in place. Some of the nicer venues have those external heaters, tall stainless steel gas burners, a constant reminder that we live in a cold part of the world. The barrier is down, giving me no choice but to turn right. As I gain the view, I finally see where all of the undead from earlier went, fucking hundreds of them, and not that far away either. There is less street lighting down there which gives them a massed, dark, shadowy look that sends shivers up my spine. There is no way I can get through them in the micro. Maybe a tank would do it, but not this thing. Twisting round in the street, and there's more behind me, running up the street. At least five or six. Fuck it. No way back and no right turn. The only option is through the precinct. Out of the car, axe in hand, and I start running into the precinct, keeping to the middle of the road. The shops and cafes are all closed, and doors and windows are barred and bolted, secured against a weekly invasion of drunken youths. To my right is one of the bars. The seating area looks like a riot has taken place, with chairs and tables thrown all over the place and massive stains of blood just about everywhere. Bodies, too. Corpses that lie still in all manner of gruesome positions. The bar has a large open frontage, and the doors are pushed back with no way of quickly securing them. Glancing back, I see that the small group of undead chasing me have reached the barrier. One of them runs into it and bends double at the waist as he slams into the barrier. The force sends his legs up and over as he somersaults and lands in a heap. Doesn't stop him, though, and he's back up, running with his zombie mates. Then, the massive horde are pouring round the corner. More of them run into the barrier, pushed forward by the relentless surge. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. And I'm off, running, flat out, with the axe in my right hand. I can run faster than them, but for how long? Something tells me this lot will never get tired or have to worry about warming up properly, pulling muscles, the cardiovascular system, or whether the muscles are being depleted of oxygen. Fuck! I scream in frustration at the sight of more coming towards me. There's fucking loads of them, behind and to the front. I'm trapped in the bloody precinct. Spinning round and round, I search for any way out, but all the premises are either locked up tight or wide open and would just get me trapped. Then I see it. A big set of old double doors. Huge Victorian ornate things and one of them is open, with warm orange light spilling out onto the street. That's my only option, so I take it. Charging across the street as I run through, over and round the metal chairs scattered everywhere. Heaving for breath, I get inside and slam the door closed behind me, finding big, sturdy bolts on the inside of the door and an even bigger, sturdier metal bar that I ram into place. I silently start praying and thanking whatever entity is looking out for me. Chapter 10 Within seconds, the doors thump as the horde reaches my point of entry. The doors are thick and strong, but old. Standing back, I bend over to get my breath, panting heavily from the exertion of running flat out. I'm in a small hallway at the bottom of a flight of wooden stairs, which are covered in a deep, red, luxurious carpet. As I mop the sweat from my head, I take in the red-coloured walls with the solid brass handrail. Soft lighting overhead gives the hallway and stairs a muted glow. Without any idea what this place is, I start heading up the stairs, axe raised and ready. At the top is a small black desk with an empty chair behind it. To the left is another set of double doors. They look heavy, like fire doors, but are painted black. I try to use my foot to push one half of the door open a little, axe ready to hit out at anything that appears, but the door is too heavy. I push harder and have to step forward as I do so. The door yields and slowly opens. The sound of disco music drifts out, getting louder as I push open the door. I pause for a second, then I keep pushing, trying to peer through as the gap widens. Slowly, I get a view of the inside as I step in, the door resting against my shoulder. I look about, taking it all in, totally stunned. The room is much bigger than I expected. The inside is dark, with chairs and tables in small groups. 
There is a bar running down the right side with discreet backlighting and glass shelves. No beer taps or optics. Lining the shelves are spirit bottles with old-fashioned metal pouring spouts stuck in the top. Ahead of me is a catwalk with a stage behind it. There are two long metal poles running floor to ceiling on the catwalk, and the back of the stage has a dark red velvet curtain. The catwalk comes out into the middle of the room with loads of the chairs and tables running all round it. The disco music is beating on, like retro porn music, and there are flashing red lights around the stage with fixed spotlights shining down onto the metal poles. The whole thing is amazing. I had no idea this place was here, but the most stunning thing is the woman on the stage. An adult female wearing just a thong with some kind of collar fastened around her neck, secured to a chain that stretches out behind her through the curtains. She's one of them. One of the things. An undead or a zombie or whatever they are. A fucking topless zombie leashed to a pole dancing stage. She's seen me. I is straining forward, pulling against the collar with frantic little lunges. Each time she jerks back hard as the chain reaches the full length with a twang. The weirdest thing is her massive fake breasts that remain motionless despite her hard tugs against the collar and chain. What the fuck? I step in and close the door. I'm not that close, but I can see that the collar is thick, almost the size of her neck. The chain looks thick too. I've never been to a lap dancing place or a strip club before, so I don't know if this is normal or what. It looks expensive, and the seats all look new and very plush. On my left and at the back of the club, there is a raised booth with a fixed microphone on a stand, facing out into the main area, and a man lying still and slumped with his back against the booth. Edging towards him with the axe raised, I keep my gaze fixed, waiting to see if he moves. He looks dead. Like proper dead, as in not one of the undead. He's wearing a dark suit with a white shirt underneath and looks very smart. Apart from the knife handle poking out of his chest, that is. A knife is buried into his chest to the hilt, and only a little bloodstain on the front of his white shirt surrounds it. I kick one of his feet gently and jump back ready to react. Nothing. I kick again a bit harder. Still nothing. Using the axe, I nudge his shoulder. He slumps over onto his side, but there's still no signs of life. Grimacing, I lean in and gently touch the side of his neck as I feel for a pulse. Not finding one, I lift one of his eyelids and see the eyes are lifeless and pale, but thankfully not red and bloodshot. His skin is cold too, like he's been dead for a while. This is my first real dead body I've seen, and it feels weird. It's not one of those things out there, or like that woman on the stage, but a real person. Dead. Christ, I even chopped a bloke's head off a few minutes ago, but this just feels different. A proper dead body. A murder victim. How senseless is that? The whole world is collapsing, the undead have arisen, and someone still has time to commit a murder? The thought brings me back to my senses. What if the killer is still here? I spin around, half expecting someone to be standing behind me with a knife aimed at my back. Someone put that stripper into the neck collar. Or maybe she was in it before she became an undead. I move away from the dead man and walk towards the bar. I lean my chest on the polished counter to see over and behind. Nothing there. All clear. There is no sign of disturbance in the club. All the tables and chairs are tidy, and the bar top is clear and clean. This all started late on Friday night, so this place would have been open. Why is it so clean and tidy? As I look about, my eyes come back to the undead stripper. She is stretched over to the side of the stage now, facing me. As I walk towards her, she tracks my movements, shuffling along at the end of her leash as I walk down the side of the catwalk. She looks no more than early twenties, and very pretty, but with harsh, garish makeup on her eyes. Peroxide blonde hair hangs down to her shoulders, and her body is very slim, which just makes those enormous boobs look even bigger. I can't see any injury on her. Maybe it's on her back, but she keeps facing toward me. 
I edge closer, watching her. She strains forward, and I can see the collar digging into the skin on her neck. She's making faint noises. I guess she would be groaning if her throat wasn't so compressed. She's standing higher than me on the catwalk, with the chain extending off the ground behind her, taut against the weight of her body pulling forward. She looks almost normal. The disco music, the lights. I can't keep my eyes from resting on her breasts. They are huge and look really hard. I've never touched a fake boob before. I wonder what they feel like. My arm extends slowly up, reaching out closer and closer. She's watching me intently, drool hanging down from her mouth. My fingertips are inches away. I move closer until I'm almost touching her. I can't believe I'm doing this, but they're just so big and swollen, almost grotesque in proportion. As my fingers connect with the cold, dead skin, two things happen at the same time. First, she lashes out with her arms in a desperate lunge to grab at me, and at the same time, a door in the corner of the room opens up, flooding the area with bright white light. A man steps into the room, pulling his fly up. I jump backwards and we stare at each other in silence as I slowly drop my arm down to my side. My face burns with shame at being caught trying to grope an undead tit. What the fuck are you doing? He asks, his voice slow and controlled. It's plainly bloody obvious what I was doing. I, I, well, I was seeing if she was okay. I try to force a natural tone, but I just sound stupid. You were seeing if she was okay. Well, is she? His tone is mocking, with the twitch of a smile at the corner of his mouth. No, I don't think she is. He shakes his head and walks further into the room. Relax, mate. But hey, they are fucking great, aren't they? What are? The tits. The big, fake tits you were groping. They're fucking amazing, and I should know I fucking paid for them. He stops at the other side of the catwalk, staring up at the topless stripper. His clothes look very similar to those worn by the dead man. Smart, dark suit, white shirt, dark tie. He plucks at the shirt cuffs under the jacket sleeves, pulling them straight. I see gold-coloured cufflinks. He looks like a London gangster from the movies, with dark hair slicked back, designer stubble and manicured fingers. Yet there is an aura about him, a threatening undertone. It is in his swagger and the sharp movements of his hands. He has a forced natural tone to his voice, like he is used to having people listen to him. He looks straight at me, holding eye contact. So, what do you think? Uh, yeah, um, they look great, really nice. I nod like I'm talking about a new car. A look of anger flashes across his face. So you were looking at her fucking tits then? His voice isn't raised, but the tone is very threatening. He stares at me, unblinking. No, no, well, I saw them. I wasn't actually looking, though. I just saw, uh, well, saw them. The anger goes instantly from his face and he softens his tone, laughing. Take it easy, mate. I'm only messing with you. She's a fucking stripper. She wants you to look at her. Alarm bells are ringing in my head. There is a dead man lying with a knife buried in his chest just a few yards behind me. An undead stripper tied to a chain on a lap dancing stage, and this bloke is trying to joke around? I want to ask him about the dead man, but for some reason, the thought of mentioning it scares me. I feel awkward. He's staring straight at me, and I can't think of anything to say. I feel like an idiot. An idiot who is holding a big axe. He moves over to the end of the bar, lifts a hatch, goes to shelves, and takes a bottle of whiskey and pours a large shot into a glass. Do you want a drink, mate? No, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Have a drink with me. A command, not a request. Just a Coke then, please. He freezes, holding the bottle a few inches from the bar top. The look of anger flashes briefly across his face again. Okay. Coke it is. 
He takes a glass bottle of Coca-Cola from the fridge and pops the lid off, then places a small black napkin on the bar, and finally the Coke bottle on the napkin. So what's it like out there? He is straight back to being calm and natural, like any bartender making conversation. Awful, really awful. I got trapped and ran through the precinct, but I got in here and locked the door with that metal bar. His mouth turns down at the edges while he nods his head. Good work. Quick thinking under pressure. You have good nerves and an eye for the ladies too. I could use a man like you, eh? You working? What the fuck? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I have a job. Oh, shame. Well, have a think about it and let me know. I'm Marcus, by the way. He extends his hand over the bar. I don't want to shake his hand. I really don't want to get that close, but I move forward anyway, too worried of the consequences. I swap the axe to my left hand and lean forward with my right. His grip is very firm, and he squeezes my hand. I'm Howie. Nice axe, Howie. Yeah, it's a uh, uh, good axe. I heft the thing up and down as though we are talking about a tennis racket. You've used it then? A casual question. He's looking at the bloodstains on the metal head, and a dark look flashes across his face. I hope you ain't drip blood up my fucking stairs. Do you know how much it fucking costs to get blood out of that carpet? I fucking tell you it costs a bloody arm and a leg. I know because I have to get it fucking cleaned every week. I keep telling those fucking gorillas not to bleed them on the fucking stairs. The darkness stays on his face a few seconds more as he lifts the glass and takes a large gulp. His fingers are white as he grips the glass. Anyway, Howie, drink your coke before it gets warm. You must be thirsty after all that running about. Straight back to calm. He's a regular Jekyll and Hyde. I take the bottle and drink some of the liquid. Despite the circumstances, the drink feels nice and cold, and I down it all. Fucking hell, Tiger, take it easy. Here, have another one. Marcus puts another bottle on the napkin, and I take it quickly. Too quickly, and he flashes another dark look at me. Sorry, I'm really thirsty. He shakes his head, shrugs nonchalantly, and pulls out a bag of white powder from the inside pocket of his jacket. He empties a small amount on the bar top and then takes something black out of his pocket. A long, thin blade shoots out of the black thing which he uses to chop at the powder, creating a thin line. He leans down and pushes a finger into the side of his nose, then snorts the line. He stands upright quickly and wipes his nose, then repeats the action with the other side. He seems unfocused for a few seconds, but he quickly comes to. Do you want some, Howie? No thanks. Suit yourself. I can't help but wonder how she got into the collar. Who bit her? Why did that man get stabbed? More than anything, though, I know that I should leave, quickly. The way he keeps saying my name is freaking me out. Is there another way out of here? He wipes at his nose again with the back of his hand, then his fingertips flick at the nostrils. Course there fucking is, Howie. Do you think the health and safety lot would let me open without having another exit? Fucking wankers. They're always in here getting a free eyeful of the birds in the dressing room. He pauses for a few seconds, looking at me. It's out the back. You don't want to go yet, do you, Howie? Barbed question. I'm sorry, but I've really got to go. He stands nodding for a few seconds, staring at me as his mouth slowly purses. Well, I think that's fucking rude, Howie. Giselle is on stage and you've had a grope of her tits. You've taken advantage of my good nature with free drinks. I know you want to fucking go. That's not very nice, is it? He walks slowly towards the gap in the bar, wiping his nose, adjusting his tie and cufflinks with small, quick movements of his hands. You see what happened to the last cunt who tried to take advantage of me, Howie? He motions to the dead man. He tried to take the piss too. Fucking won't do that again, will he, Howie? Look, mate, I don't want any trouble. I'm just trying to find my parents and get out of here. It was very kind of you to give me the drinks. No, 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 Howie. 
You don't just take a free drink. There ain't no such thing as free in this world, Howie. You always have to pay. As he steps through the hatch, I start moving backwards away from him. Nothing is free, Howie. Now you've had a look at the girl in my club, which I paid for. Had a grope of her fucking tits, which I paid for. Had a drink, which I fucking paid for. Please, Marcus, I just want to leave. You ain't fucking leaving, Howie, he snorts with laughter. Not until you understand that nothing is for fucking free. Uh, Okay, what do you want? I don't have any money. He walks towards me and casually picks the knife up from the bar holding it down at his side while he stares directly into my eyes. Mate, what are you doing? Please just let me go. Howie, Howie, it's not that I don't want to let you go. It's that I can't. If I let you go, everyone will say that Marcus is a soft touch, that he's fucking lost it. Respect, Howie. you got to have respect. You understand that, don't you? Marcus... You don't have to kill me. The whole world has gone mad. I've just been chased by zombies, for God's sake. Please, just let me go. I won't... You won't what? What won't you do, Howie? Call the police? He starts laughing. I don't think they'll help you now, Howie. It's just me and you and our little debt. Debt? What do you want, then? He stops, a slight smile forming on his mouth. Well, Howie... Seeing as you groped her tits, I think you should say sorry. Giselle was always moaning that the punters were fucking rude trying to grope her tits and ass. Okay, I'm very sorry. I really didn't mean to cause any offence, and I apologise. He shakes his head. I don't think that'll be enough, Howie. You'll have to apologise to her. He motions towards the stage with a knife. Turning round, I make a point of looking at the undead stripper, still pulling against the neck collar. I'm really sorry, Giselle. I hope I didn't offend you. Please accept my apologies. After years of practice calming down irate and angry customers in the supermarket, I surprise myself with how sincere I sound. He looks at Giselle, then back at me. Mm. Good apology, Howie. But you know what will really say sorry? Really show Giselle that you mean it? His voice is very low. What? The hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. A kiss, Owie. A nice kiss to say sorry always works with women. They fucking love it. There is a look of excitement in his eyes. The sick bastard is enjoying this. Tell you what. Owie, seeing as it's quiet in here tonight, when you're giving her a kiss, you can have another feel of her tits. How about that? A free grope? No, 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 I I don't think that's right. Oh, you don't fucking think that's right? Who the fuck are you? Trying to stick your fucking dick in her mouth, weren't you? You fucking pervert. Now it's fucking wrong, is it? I say what's fucking right and wrong in my fucking club, not you. I lift the axe. A little. Just a slight raise, more to reassure myself that I'm still holding it. A maniacal grin spreads on his face as he spots the movement. Oh now, Howie, Howie. There's no need for that. Just go and give Giselle a little kiss, squeeze her tits, and you can go. No, mate. No way. Give Giselle a fucking kiss. No. He walks toward me, the knife steady in his right hand. The other hand wipes at his nose, then checks his tie, smoothing down the front of his shirt and jacket. He walks around the edge of the catwalk. I start moving backwards, but only have a short distance before I am trapped by the stage and Giselle straining at her leash. Where you gonna go, Owie? The exit is the other side of the stage. Giselle tracks his movements as he walks round the edge of the catwalk towards me, her upper body leaning forward, straining against the collar. Look at you backing away like a pussy. 
big fucking man a minute ago when you were alone with Giselle, weren't you? Now look at you, Mr. Fucking Pussy. Mocking and laughing at me, the knife held easy in his hand. Where are you going, Howie? Trying to get a free fuck from my girl and now running off with your cock in your hand? What? Mate, please. Please what, you fucking pussy? The mocking morphs into a snarl as that dark look flashes across his face again. My right hand brushes against the back of a chair as the images of the last 24 hours whirl through my mind. Breathing harder now, heart hammering in my chest, I look down at the blood and the gore on the metal axe head. About twelve. I look up at him as he stops and stares at me with a glance of confusion. Twelve what? First with a hammer, then two with my feet, then a few with a baseball bat. I also set some on fire and burnt a village down. I take hold of the back of the chair and I start to step towards him, dragging the chair behind me. The first one with the axe was huge. I chopped his head off and then some more after that. So I reckon, Marcus, that I have killed about twelve of them since last night. And I run in here to find shelter and meet a fucking psycho instead. So, you know what you can do, Marcus? You can fuck off! I launch the chair at him, swinging my arm from behind me with all of my strength. It would never really hurt him, but his reaction is to step back. Step back against the edge of the catwalk. He blocks the chair and laughs, just as Giselle drops down and sinks her teeth into the top of his head, her hands clawing at his face. She bites down hard, blood spurting out and soaking her face, pouring down his head. He screams and lashes out, the knife is still in his hand and he keeps stabbing the blade at her shoulders. She gets cut again and again but keeps going. He sinks down, slashing at her hands on his face, cutting his own skin with the desperate effort to get her off. His legs buckle and he drops down as Giselle tears a chunk of scalp with a horrible, wet, ripping sound. Marcus writhes in agony, clutching the top of his bloodied head while Giselle strains forward, a chunk of hairy scalp dangling from her mouth. Giving them both a wide berth, I run around the side of the catwalk looking for the exit. The toilet door is there, but nothing else. It must be through the stage. I climb up and push through the curtain. The back area is dark and dimly lit by red bulbs. Not giving my eyes enough time to adjust to the gloom, I go blundering through and trip over a big box, sprawling onto the stage floor surrounded by feather boas, thongs, chains, whips and bottles of pressurised whipped cream. Lifting my hand up, I stare and wonder at the set of glittery handcuffs and look down to see another one of the neck collars with a chain attached. Moving quickly, I head back out to the front, attaching a leather strap at the end of the chain to one of the shiny metal poles on the stage. Giselle is still trying to reach down to Marcus, writhing about on the floor in front of her, his wails of pain sounding easily above the disco porn music. From this view, I can see where she was bitten, right on her once perfect backside with a huge chunk of flesh torn away. Once I'm at Marcus's side, I put one end of the handcuffs through the chain and close the loop. I then lean down, keeping away from Giselle, and grab at Marcus's wrist, attaching the handcuff and locking it securely on him before jumping back as he surges up to attack me. You cunt! He screams, his face covered in blood. I move backwards away from him as he comes at me. The handcuffs pull the chain which goes taut from being secured to the pole, and he is jerked back off his feet, screaming as he starts clutching at the manacle on his wrist. No! Fuck no! He keeps pulling, then starts tugging at the chain. He follows the line and sees it is secured to the pole, but only with a leather strap. I'll cut you up, you little fucking runt! He growls as he starts towards the edge of the stage, but Giselle lunges at him again, driving him back. With his back turned, I rush forward and grab the fallen knife from the ground. Looks like you're stuck, mate. He spins round to face me, his face immediately changing as the fury ebbs away. 
Please, I was only joking. I wouldn't have done anything to you. Come on, Howie, please let me go. I lift the hatch and nip behind the bar, and after finding a clean glass, pour a large shot from the bottle he used a few minutes ago. Have a drink with me, Marcus? No? Okay, suit yourself. I gulp it down in one mouthful. The liquid burns my throat and makes me cough, and I spit it out on the bar. Cool. Very cool. Owie, come on, mate. Please let me go, eh? Eh, mate? You wouldn't leave me like this, would you? You fucking cunt! I'll slice you in the bits and fucking feed you to her! He switches between sobbing and wild fury as the cocaine and adrenaline pulse through his body, constantly working at the handcuff as though he can slip his wrist through, then pulling at the chain. He finally stops pulling and touches the top of his head. His hand comes away bloody, which he stares at, looking confused. I watch as he scrabbles to take out his bag of white powder from the inside of his jacket with one hand, but he's shaking and trembling. Trying to open the bag, he fumbles and drops it on the floor, the white powder bursting out, covering the carpet. He drops down and snorts his nose against the floor, snuffling about like a hungry pig. Owie, you can't leave me like this. I'll die, he begs, standing back up with white powder stuck round his nose and mouth. It mixes with the blood and turns a weird shade of pink. Fucking hell, not like this, he wails. Not like this! He roars into the air before attacking the handcuff with his free hand, ramming his arm back again and again, which drives the metal edge deep into the flesh on his wrist, cutting him open. More blood pumps out, but he doesn't stop. If anything, it drives him on to tug and yank with all his might. He stops instantly. Going completely still, he stares at me with wide eyes before grabbing at his stomach and bending double. Edging forward, I watch him sink to the floor, clutching his midsection as he screams in agony. The pain seems to intensify as he screams louder and then trails off breathing in hard, shallow pants. Then he's gone. Dead. Completely still and there's no doubt about it. He just died. Not breathing, not moving, nothing. Shit. I did that. I caused him to die. Was it from the bite or the cocaine or too much blood loss? Rocking back, I cast about in shock until movement catches my eye. He twitches, his limbs spasm, and the twitches increase as though an electric current is being put through him. He doesn't scream or cry out, but just twitches for a few seconds until he sits up in one smooth movement, turning his head to stare at me through red, bloodshot eyes. Drool is already coming out of his mouth as he tries to stand up with jerky, spasmodic movements. Giselle has already lost interest in him and has turned to face me. Both of them face me. Both of them drooling and groaning quietly. But thankfully, both of them are chained up. Chapter 11 The exit is through the back of the stage, a rear door that leads out onto a set of concrete steps going down to the ground floor. As I reach the bottom of the stairs, there are doors to the left and right, and what must be the street door ahead of me. A red fire extinguisher is hooked on the wall. The street door is solid wood, and I have no view of what's on the other side. I've lost my bearings and can't work out if the door opens onto the high street. It must do. How far up am I from the entrance to the club? No, it opens out to the rear of the club. I went in the main entrance and turned left into the club, then out the stage door and turned right down the stairs. It must be the rear. So these other doors must lead into the shops on the high street? I can't remember what shops are in this area. There must be windows in the shops. I'll be able to see out the front and maybe the rear and then work out the safest escape route. If I open the street door and the undead are there, I might not be able to close it again. I try the doors that must lead into the shops, but they're locked. They don't look that formidable. So I try to push against one of them. It yields slightly. So I take a step back and slam my shoulder against the door, just like they do on TV, and bounce straight off, yelping at the pain in my shoulder. Next, I kick at the door, aiming at the middle where the lock would be. 
The door holds, but it doesn't feel that strong, and I kick again, harder. The door holds, but I can feel it starting to buckle. Another two hard kicks, and the door bursts open. I've always wanted to do that. Kick open a door and burst through with an axe, shouting, Here's Johnny! My great plan backfires as I hear a loud and constant beeping sound. The alarm. There's maybe a minute before it starts sounding properly, alerting every one of those things in the area. Here's Howie. Come and eat him. I rush in through a storeroom. There are boxes stacked up and clothes rails with garments hanging off them. And with no lights on, the place is shadowy and foreboding. I go through the eerie storeroom to an office area where I find the alarm panel illuminated on the wall. A standard ten-digit number pad with buttons marked Enter and Reset. Shit, there must be a code. I know most places have them written down somewhere. The high call-out engineer costs for resetting the alarm means they nearly always put it somewhere close. So staff that are either half asleep or half drunk from the night before can switch it off. It's too dark to see anything, and I waste vital seconds looking for the light switch, eventually finding it. I then see a desk with a computer and a yearly planner on the wall with the staff annual leave marked out. Box files and folders are stacked untidily on shelves, with new till receipt rolls spilling out of them. I check on the desk, sifting through bits of paper as the constant beeping sound spurs me on. Then the desk jotter, which is just full of doodles, scribbles and mobile phone numbers. Opening drawers, I root through calculators, highlighter pens, a stapler, a hole punch and more crap that all goes flying as I get more frantic. The countdown is done. As I reach for the shelves to check along them, the alarm starts wailing properly. A full-on ear-splitting warble that makes me want to shake my head to get the noise away. In my mind, I can imagine every undead stopping still to slowly turn and listen to the stonking great alarm blaring out. I stare daggers at the alarm panel, contemplating smashing the fucking thing with my axe. Then I see the six-digit number, right there on the panel, written in pencil. Shaking my head, I key the numbers in and press enter, breathing a sigh of relief when the alarm cuts out. I go back into the storeroom. A door leads to a toilet, and I find the staff room, just a small kitchen really, with a cheap table and chairs. There is a small workshop with a sink, a kettle, and an old two-slice toaster. They make these staff rooms unwelcoming to try and put the staff off spending too much time in them. A two-slice toaster, so you can only do enough for yourself and not encourage others to loiter. Something about the kettle and toaster and the thought of tea and toast sends a pang of sadness through me, like being really homesick. As I turn to leave, a pinboard on the wall catches my eye. The board is full of pictures of young women on nights out. The staff fall out for a laugh, pictured in various poses, holding drinks and pulling faces. They look young and carefree. The images might have been taken just a few days ago. Young people with their whole lives ahead of them, working together, going out and drinking, having relationships, listening to music, discussing what outfit to wear. Bloody hell, it's all gone now. That sense of sadness fills me completely, and I suddenly feel very lonely. Maybe it's better to be like Marcus and get smashed out of your face on drugs and alcohol. Leaving the staff room, I decide to check the rest of the store. If it's safe, I'll stay for a little while. I leave the key in the door, in case I need a rapid exit. Finally, I find the door that leads onto the shop floor. It's very dark. There are rows of clothes hanging from rails against the walls and various standing rails on the floor. The shop looks big, and I can see the brand name, New Look, on every available surface and wall. Of all the shops I could have gone into, I get a ladies' fashion store. Hang on, they do men's clothing as well, don't they? I move deeper into the store, crouching down to move between the rails until I'm flat on my tummy, poking my head out from under a load of dresses to stare at the large glass display windows at the front. Dressed-up mannequins adorn the plinth, glittering and looking just fabulous, darling, under the subdued and expertly fitted lights. Other than the mannequins, there are shitloads of the undead staring in, nasty, bloodied faces pushing against the glass as they sway and move about. It takes me a few seconds of watching, but I slowly get the impression they are not actually staring at me, but rather just standing there. 
The alarm has certainly attracted them. They're stacked up, staring inside, shuffling and moving about. I stay completely still. None of them are actually looking at me, or even in my direction. I decide to wait for a while to see if they will move off, but after a few minutes, the hard floor starts to make me very uncomfortable, and despite the warm summer, it feels quite cold. Moving backwards on my belly, slithering away out of sight, I stay low, until I'm sure that the many clothes rails will keep me blocked. I move over to the side and check down the other end of the store. It appears to lead towards changing rooms, and, judging by the size of the store, it must lead to the other door in the stairwell too. So this is all one shop. That makes me feel better. On my way back towards the door of the stockroom, I stop at a rail of thick, woollen cardigans. They are women's sizes, size 10 at the front, and getting larger as they go back. I have no idea what size I am in women's clothing, so I take one from the back. I head into the dark staff room and start trying to put the kettle on. The cardigan is so big, the sleeves extend well beyond the length of my arms, and the thick collar pretty much swallows my head too. After squabbling about to roll the sleeves up and free my eyes, I get the kettle on and root about until I find a large chipped mug. Two big teaspoons of sugar, a tea bag and some milk from the fridge. Opening the fridge, I find a loaf of bread on the middle shelf. Who keeps bread in the fridge? Maybe it's a policy of the store. Rule 1 of the New Look Charter. Section 1, subsection 1. All bread will be kept in the fridge. Shaking my head, I finish off brewing up and make use of the bread by getting some toast on the go. A couple of minutes later, and I've got a fresh steaming cup of tea and two slices of lovely toast, which is devoured almost instantly. It tastes lovely and serves to remind me how hungry I am. So I keep going, toasting more bread and even finding some marmalade from the fridge. Sitting back, I feel the first, slightest sense of contentment since last night. Bloody hell, this only started last night. It feels like that was weeks ago. I've already had countless lucky escapes, but I have got to be more careful and think things through clearly. I have to get back to my parents and see if they've returned, then head for London to find my sister. Right now, though, I can't do anything. The place has got undead crawling about, so I have no choice but to sit tight and wait for them to piss off. I lean forward to rest my head against the thick material of the cardigan. Better go and check in a few minutes. Can't stay here too long. Chapter 12 I wake with a start, wondering where I am. I have that slightly sick feeling that you get when you can't immediately place your surroundings. I've dribbled on the cardigan as I slept. It looks like a slug has crawled across my sleeve and I wipe at the wet saliva on my cheek. I really need to pee as the slightly too tight jeans are pressing into my bladder, which is full from all the tea I drank. Blundering about in the dark, I find the staff toilet and take a long piss, feeling that lovely relieving sensation as my bladder empties. Even in the gloom, I can see my piss is dark, and I remember the urine colour chart on the wall of the staff toilets in the supermarket. If your urine was too dark, it meant you were dehydrated. Drink more water and stay healthy. I need to drink more water. I should prepare my journeys now and plan accordingly. I need another bag to carry water in and supplies, and more weapons. Definitely more weapons. I go back out onto the shop floor, and once again inch forward until I am in the same spot, peeking out between long dresses. The undead have gone. I can't see any now. It has just gone 2.30am. I must have dozed off for a couple of hours. I feel better, but my mouth feels furry and I need to brush my teeth. Again, I chastise myself for not thinking about this before. Washing, eating and getting water are essential now. Once satisfied that the front is clear, I move off deeper into the store. The men's section is tiny in comparison to the main area and is sectioned off by high display walls. I crawl through until I'm completely blocked from view so I can move with more ease. I am looking for another pair of jeans, but all I can see are those fucking awful skinny jeans and brown trousers with a massive saggy ass look. I need dark clothing that I can move quickly in. I find some black utility trousers, pockets on the side, like combat trousers. These are fashionable. 
with bits of material hanging off. I find my size and try them on. They have a belt supplied and fit well. I yank off the hanging material strips and loops until they look fairly normal. My trainers are filthy and covered in dried blood, so next I head for the shoes section, but they only have thin, plimpsole-type fashion shoes, like those nasty black things we had to wear for PE at school. There is one pair of boots, but they are high with big heels and designed to be worn with the sides hanging down. No good. On to upper garments, and I find a thin, long-sleeved black top with a hood. The bags are no good either. They're old-fashioned, explorer-type bags with thin straps. They look great, but they're not practical, no good for running with. Then, changing my mind, I take one of the dark brown explorer bags and find new boxer shorts and socks. I pull the packaging free and stuff several pairs of each into the bag. Then I put another of the same tops in, after pulling off the tags. Finally, I put a slightly thicker jumper in the bag too. I go back into the staff room and use the small sink to wash my body and change my underwear. Dressed again, I feel better, cleaner and more prepared. I will need sturdier shoes though. I've had to use my feet several times already to kick at undead and these flimsy trainers don't give any protection. The Tesco supermarket where I work isn't too far away. It's open 24 hours, so it would have been open when this started on Friday night. It will surely be infested, but then there is a rear staff door with a keypad entry system. I know the building like the back of my hand, and I should be able to get in and out quickly. The home delivery vans are parked out the back too, and the keys are in the duty manager's office. It's risky, but it must be better than going to a strange place where I don't know the layout. All I have to do is get out of here, and I can use the side streets. The only window facing the rear of the building is in the staff room. And this has frosted glass with bars on the frame. I go through and open the smaller window first, listening until I am sure there are no sounds. The larger window is sealed shut, probably to prevent staff passing goods to people outside. I can't hear anything, but the risk is too great. I make my way carefully through the shop floor, moving between the clothes stands, until I'm just a few steps away from the front windows. The street lights are still on outside, but I can't see any undead in front of the store. There are two lady mannequins on a raised plinth in the window display, and I step up to stand between them. This gives me a better view of the street. To the left, there is the massive horde of undead still milling around the door that I went through some time ago. There must be hundreds of them. They look slow and cumbersome now, but I know that they can switch on when they have prey in their sights. Looking intently at the horde on the left, I fail to see the single male undead shuffling past the window from my right until he is right next to me. He's inches away, and I stand stock still as he slowly passes by. The front is out of the question. There are simply too many of them. The second that I exit the store, they'll see me. And although I've outrun them so far, I can't take that chance of getting trapped again. The rear exit is the only choice. In the stairwell, the bag is on my back, and I have the axe in hand. I stare intently at the back door, wondering if I should go slowly or burst out. I decide on the slower option. I can always try and pull the door shut if one of them comes at me, and it'll be a lot quieter as well. I push the metal bar down gently, keeping my movements very slow and controlled. The door is well used, and is fairly easy to open. I peer out, alert for the slightest movement. All clear. Axe in my left hand and a firm grip on the door handle with my right, I lean forward. Still no one dead. I'm in a small service road that runs along the back of the shops. I take the fire extinguisher and prop the door slightly open. It looks closed, but I know that I can get back in if I need to. Down the road, there is a turning to the right, which heads away from the town centre with a row of parked cars on the right. I stay to this side, keeping low and using the cars to cover me. It is much darker here with no street lighting. Commercial units and storage places give way to houses, and I'm into well-lit suburbia. The darkness was good to creep along in, but bloody scary and deep shadows everywhere. The street lights here will mean that I am seen by them easier, but they will also help me to see them quicker. I keep the axe low to avoid the metal glinting from the lights, and I keep on through residential streets that are strangely quiet, I find the same signs of devastation here, 
open front doors and the odd body lying in a pool of dried blood. After a few minutes, I pass a car in the middle of the road that has crashed into the parked vehicles. The windscreen is smashed and the doors are open. Bloodstains are on the road, so I quicken my pace to get past quickly. Some of the houses have lights on inside that offer the street a warm, inviting glow, and I want to think of people sitting inside, watching television and drinking tea, instead of having to deal with this horror. A main road crosses the end of the residential streets. I can see the Tesco garage on the other side, all in darkness. The front door has been smashed in, and I can see packets of items littered on the forecourt. The fuel pumps have an automated system for credit cards at night, and the small shop is closed. After several minutes of watching for any movement, I go over the road and cross the forecourt quickly, reaching the shadows on the other side without issue. Over a small wall and I am into the supermarket car park, a vast open space with plastic roof trolley bays dotted about. There are very few cars here, just a row of some dozen or so parked in the area that the night staff use. The main building is ahead of me, it is brightly lit. The massive red Tesco sign is like a beacon in the dark night, but I can't see anyone moving about from this distance. To the right of the building, there's a very high fence which runs around the back, and there is a double gate entry point for delivery trucks and a single walkthrough gate with a keypad for staff to use. The vehicle gates look closed from here. They're normally controlled by staff monitoring the CCTV cameras in the security office and can be opened electronically. I move right and keep to the edge of the car park, skirting round until I reach the high fencing. At the single gate, I enter the code and it buzzes to show that the lock is disengaged. I push the gate and enter the rear compound, stopping to look about and make sure it's clear before I proceed. The gate has the same keypad on the inside, so there is no need to keep it open for a fast exit. To my left is the side of the main building, sheer and windowless. There are several home delivery trucks parked to the side in bays, facing towards the gates. A wide, sweeping access road goes around the rear of the building to the delivery bays. There are wooden benches set aside, used by the staff that smoke or those who want to sit outside during their breaks. I can see from here that the staff access door is closed. Keeping to the far side, I move forward until I get a full view of the back of the store. There is a long Tesco truck backed up to the loading platform and someone moving around in the shadows. Watching quietly, I wait until the figure moves into the moonlit road and I see that it's an undead male, big built and shuffling along slowly towards the rear staff door. The lorry in the loading bay means that there will be open doors into the storerooms so the stock can be taken in. I could go that way, but it is a big area. I want to go in the side door so I can get to the security office and use the cameras to look around the store. There are just as many cameras in the staff and stock rooms as there are on the shop floor. Loss prevention, they call it. But in reality, they just don't trust the staff. If I want to use that side door, I'll have to deal with him. Keeping low and to the perimeter, I make my way round the side of the building, then start coming back towards the side door from the other direction, sticking to the dark shadows at the side. I'm still at least 30 metres from him when he spins round, suddenly aware of my presence. There is no pause or delay as he starts running at me, gathering speed despite his jerky motion. I step away from the building so I have space around me, moving left and drawing him out into the open. He's dressed in blue trousers and a blue polo shirt with the Tesco logo, and looks to be in his late forties, with a big gut hanging over the top of his trousers. One half of his face looks torn away. I don't recognise him, but he looks like a truck driver. I will only get one shot at this before he is on me. I lift the axe and hold it ready, just as he gets in range. Then I step to the right and sway at his head. The impact sends him careering off and he sprawls onto the ground. I move in before he can get up and slam the sharp edge into his brain. There's a sickening crunch and squelch as his skull bursts open and the soft matter underneath is destroyed. I pull the axe out and look around me, checking that the noise hasn't drawn anyone else and feeling rather proud of myself. How many is that now? I told Marcus it was about twelve. 
So including Marcus and this truck driver, I make that about 14 of the undead things I've killed. No, hang on. Marcus wasn't an undead. He turned into an undead, but that was after he got killed. Shit, so can I count him or not? Actually, that makes me feel quite bad that I killed a real person. Fair enough, he was waving a knife at me while snorting cocaine and trying to urge me to shag his zombie stripper girlfriend, but even so... Shit, get a grip, Howie. Standing here like a fool, adding up your body count. At the staff door, I key the numbered code into the keypad and listen for the buzz and click as the lock releases. Easing the door open, I peer into the gloomy interior, pausing so I can listen for movement. Inside, I move down the corridor to the security office. The door is closed, but not locked. I enter the room and see several monitors on a desk in front of a keyboard and a joystick. Two swivel chairs are in front of the desk. Bert is sitting in one of the chairs. He's leaning back in the chair with his arms hanging down at his sides. Huge pools of blood have formed underneath him, and there is a packing knife in the blood under his right hand. Bert had rolled his sleeves up before opening his veins. Even at the point of taking his own life, he still took the time to roll them smartly above the elbow. I can see old army-style tattoos on his forearms, faded with time. He was a very proud man, and in a way, I almost feel glad that he decided to choose his own fate, rather than face becoming one of them. The problem now is that in order to get to the monitors, I'm going to have to go through the big pools of blood on the floor. I walk gently through the blood and go to push the chair out of the way. The chair is not on wheels, though, and pushing it causes my feet to lose grip and slip from under me. I land heavily on my knees in the pool of blood as my head stops inches above Bert's groin. I go to stand up, but the floor is like ice now. My trainers can't get a grip, and I have to use the chair to leave myself upright, then twist round and fall into the second seat. My trouser legs are soaked through, and I can feel the cold liquid on my skin. I only just got these trousers too. Shaking my head at my own incompetence, I look towards the monitors. I got on well with Bert, and he once showed me how the system worked. I know how to move between all of the cameras and have them displayed as a split screen with four, eight, or up to 32 very small images. The joystick controls the camera movement and focus. The company invests heavily in state-of-the-art security. A camera in one corner can be zoomed in to read the packaging from an item on a shelf in the far corner. Starting with the staff area, I commence flicking through the live feeds, and I'm surprised that there are no undead in the back rooms. I go through the different sections, the canteen, the office areas and the locker rooms, but they're all clear. In the dry goods stockroom, the largest of the storage areas, I can see a large mound on the floor near the far corner. The dry goods room is very dark and it's hard to see what it is. I zoom the camera in and can see that the heap is made from stacked up bodies. There are limbs hanging out from the pile. It's too dark to see clearly, but there are at least seven or eight bodies all on top of each other. What the fuck? Muttering to myself, I move the camera about, but cannot see anything else. No movement. All the rest of the staff area is clear. Selecting the shop floor cameras, I start looking at the main store feeds and instantly see another huge pile in the wide central aisle that runs the full width of the store. Full colour, and with the lights on within the store, I can make out every gory detail. Bodies. Lots of bodies, all piled on top of each other into a big mound. Men, women and children, and all of them with various injuries, bite marks, ragged flesh hanging open, limbs bitten through, bones exposed. The sheer amount of blood is immense, with large pools slowly spreading out from the big mound. Several mops and buckets stand nearby, and I can see someone has made an effort to clean up. With shaking hands, I use the joystick to flick through the other camera feeds, spotting slick, bloody drag marks going through the aisles where the bodies have been dragged along. Most of them have severed jugulars, necks slashed open with deep wounds. Some of the bodies on the top and outer edges are visible to the camera, and I can see the red, bloodshot eyes staring out lifelessly. There is a single arm on top of the highest pile, as if it has been chucked up there. 
This is the last thing I had expected to see. I knew that the place would be crawling with undead, but I wasn't expecting them to be dead undead, and certainly not stacked up like this. The next monitor along has been left focused on the store entrance. Movement catches my eye, and I see an undead female staggering into the store. She's moving fast, like she has seen prey. I check the list for the camera numbers and watch her path through various feeds. She moves past the security barriers and towards the customer service desk. I select a camera fixed above the main door and move it to see the service desk area. There is a man wearing a Tesco uniform facing the oncoming undead female. He stands still with his arms hanging by his sides. I try to zoom in closer to see who it is, but the undead blocks my view as she charges him. The man lifts his right arm, drops down and spins off to the side in one fluid motion, coming to stop with his back to the camera, facing towards the service desk. As he comes into view, I see that he has a massive orange-handled butcher's knife in his hand. The knife is reversed and the blade is upright, resting against his forearm. The blade that just sliced across the throat of the undead female who has crashed into the desk and is now on the floor. I see crimson spurting from her throat area as she spasms, and within seconds, she's motionless. The man walks over and looks down at the undead female. He has his back to me. I still can't see who it is. The man appears satisfied that she's done for, and bends down to pick her leg up by the ankle. He then starts dragging her body towards the central aisle. I change camera view and focus on the section that he will walk into. There are already several clear, bloody drag marks on the floor. He must have done the same thing countless times. As the man comes into view, his head is down, carefully avoiding the slippery wake he has left before. He lifts his head, and I'm amazed to see that it's one of the night shelf stackers. I rack my brains trying to remember his name. David. No, Dave. That's it. Dave. He always corrected me if I called him David. A small built man with a wiry frame and short fair hair cut close to his scalp, maybe a grade four. He joined the store about a year ago on the night shift. He was a very hard worker, quiet and kept to himself. He impressed the managers with his consistent working pace and they frequently offered him the chance to move on to the day shifts, but he always refused. I remember trying to talk to him on several occasions. He always called me Mr. Howie, despite my telling him several times he could call me just Howie. The store prefers first names for the managers, as it tries to promote a friendly one-team approach. Dave would just stay quiet. He was never silent in a disrespectful way. He was just a very withdrawn man. We couldn't even work out his age. He could be anywhere from late 20s to early 40s. There was even a bet running in the canteen on his age. The other night staff were always asking him how old he was. He would just give a little smile and carry on with what he was doing. And he was always doing something. In fact, I can't think of a time that he said more than five words in the same sentence. Dave has dragged the body round to the far side of the heap and pushed it into the pile. An arm flopped out and he lifted it up and pushed it back in. It flopped out again and he pushed it under another body. Neat and tidy. He then turned and walked back down to the service desk. There, he picked up a long, thin metallic stick and started running the butcher's blade up and down it while looking at the door. On the desk behind him, I can see more knives from the meat department. Huge cleavers and normal straight-bladed knives. There's even a long metal shaft with a hook at one end and a handle at the other. Dave just stands watching the door, his knife moving in perfect motion up and down the sharpening tool. Chapter 13 I leave the security office and make my way onto the shop floor with my axe. The bright lights blind me a little after the darkness of the back area. There is piped music playing low, and I head towards the central aisle, passing the heap of bodies. I suddenly become very nervous, and I call out so he doesn't think I'm trying to sneak up on him. Dave? It's Howie. You there? Is it okay if I come down? 
Dave appears at the end of the aisle ahead of me. The two implements are held down at his sides. Mr. Howie, sir. He nods, smartly. I wait in the central aisle, and then look at the piled-up bodies on the floor. There is a rancid, rotten smell coming from them, and they don't look real. There are too many of them to look real. There was a pile in the dry goods room, plus the ones in the aisles at the back of the store, and now these. He must have killed at least a hundred of them. The sight of the wounds, red eyes, slack mouths and limbs, all in various states, are too much for me, and the contents of my stomach heave up. I bend over and vomit onto the floor, putting my hand out to steady myself. I keep retching until nothing but bile is coming out. My throat burns, and my eyes are watering. Dave is suddenly next to me, handing me a bottle. Some water. I take the bottle and unscrew the cap, taking big gulps to soothe the burning in my throat. Sorry, Mr. Howie. I look up, fearful that he is apologising before cutting my head off, but he's standing there with a very slight, pained expression on his face. For the bodies. He motions to the heaped cadavers. Every time I try to clear them up, more come in. That was a long speech for Dave. He doesn't look or sound threatening. In fact, he looks the same as he always does. His shirt is tucked into his blue trousers, his fleece is zipped up with the collar down, the buttons of his polo shirt are done up. There are just a few bloodstains on his hands. He notices me looking at his hands and walks back to the service desk. I follow him there and watch as he takes an antiseptic wipe from a pack, methodically cleaning the blood from his hands. I don't know what to say. He sees me looking at the wipes. I paid for them. No, it's fine. Don't worry. I feel dizzy after the vomiting and sway on my feet. Dave rushes to my side and helps lower me down onto the ground. I sit down with my head between my knees, the axe at my side. Rest now. He goes back to sharpening the knife and watching the door, and then he stops and walks off towards the chilled drinks cabinet by the front. He returns within seconds and silently hands me a bottle of Lucasade. How long have you been here, Dave? He thinks for a second. Eleven months? No, I know that. I mean, how long now? He raises his head slightly. Friday. You've been here since Friday? Since this started? He nods. Why are you here, Dave? He pauses his sharpening and stares at me, expressionless. Then he looks down at his uniform and back at me. No, I don't mean why are you here? You work here. I mean, why are you still here when this is happening? He shrugs. Don't you have a family? No. A home, even? Where do you live? South Street. South Street is in the town centre, right by the High Street. That area would be crawling with undead. No family or relatives? He shakes his head and continues with the sharpening. I watch him work. His eyes never leave the front of the store. He stops, and although he remains expressionless, there is a change in his eyes. A set and fixed stare. I twist round but can't see anything, so I stand up and look out the front. There are several undead coming across the car park. Dave calmly puts the sharpener back on the desk, then hovers his hand over the handles of the knives. He selects a smaller, straight-bladed, black-handled knife. He reverses both of the knives so they are upright against his forearms and starts walking towards the entrance doors. He stops a few feet back from the doors and stands waiting. I heft my axe and go down to stand beside him. He looks at me, then at the ground between us. Too close, Mr. Howie, he states, matter-of-factly. Sorry. I take a few steps to the side. He turns his head back to the undead. They're closer now, and I can see there are four of them, three males and one female, all adults. They are dressed in formal evening wear. The female has a gold-coloured gown, and the men are wearing dark suits, and I wonder where they've come from. 
they're advancing in a staggered line with the female at the front. As they get within a few metres of the door, Dave runs out, going straight towards the female. As she leans in for the bite, he sidesteps and brushes the straight-bladed knife against her throat, his forward momentum causing the blade to dig as he draws it across. His right arm is extended, and the long, orange-handled knife is held out in front like a sword. He then plunges into the neck of the next undead male, pushing it deep. He spins round with incredible dexterity and draws the knife out, dropping down. Then he uses both knives to thrust upwards at the chest of the next one, repeated stabs into the ribcage as he pushes upwards, forcing the undead back. Then he viciously drives the straight blade into the forehead. One left, and Dave lets him come on. At the last second, he spins round the back of the undead and grips the hair on the back of his head, yanking him. The blade soars at the exposed neck, opening an artery which sprays high into the air. He lets the body slump to the ground, then looks left and right, turns and scans the rest of the car park. I am still standing in the entrance area, holding my axe, my mouth open. He was so clinical, not savage or violent. Well, it was violent, incredibly violent, but not in a demented sense. Like I had swung my axe and hoped for the best, he was precise and exact. Dave checks the area and then walks back to the undead male, the one with the knife sticking out of his forehead. He then leans down and puts his foot on the undead's face and pulls the knife out quickly. He wipes both blades on the undead's clothing and starts walking back towards me. But he stops at the female, bends down to grasp her ankle and starts pulling her into the store. He nods as he passes me. Mr Howie? I go after him as he trails the body up the aisle. Her arms are out behind her. The front of her gown is stained red and there are bite marks all over her arms. Dave, you don't have to stack them up. He stops and looks back at me, then down at the body. He lets go of the leg, which falls to the floor with a thump. OK. He goes back to the desk and uses the wipes to clean his hands, and then the bloody blades. Dave, have you got anywhere else to go? He pauses, then slowly shakes his head. No, Mr Howie. Listen, mate, you can't stay here. They will keep coming. You can't keep stacking them up. They'll decay and rot. The electricity won't last that long either. There are survivors heading to the forts on the coast. You could go there. Take a delivery truck from the back. He pauses, clearly thinking. I can't. Why not? I can't drive. I can show you. It's really easy. I don't have a license. Dave... No one will care. There is no police or authority now, and you can do what you want. He seems suddenly unsure, like the notion is too much to grasp. He looks left, right, and then at me, a quizzical expression on his face that I've never seen before. He is clearly very worried. Or you could come with me. I have to find my parents and my sister, then I'm going to the forts. I almost curse myself for saying it but he looks lost and floundering. He could kill me easily without hesitation, but then he hasn't shown any threat or signs of evil intent yet. In fact, he's acted the same as always, and he'd be very handy to have nearby. The worried expression has gone from him instantly. Okay, Mr Howie. That's it. No hesitation or questions, no wondering about who or where. He makes an instant decision and he's back to being normal Dave. I need to change my clothes. I'm covered in blood. I start to walk over to the clothing section on the far side. Blood? Not mine, but the security man slit his wrists in the security office. Oh, you could get some more clothes if you wanted to, Dave. No money. He shakes his head. It's okay, you can just take them. He seems unsure again. Uh, I'm a manager, Dave. I can sign for them to be given out. Okay. He follows me to the clothes section. 
At the clothes section, I drop my bag down and start looking about. Most of the clothing is cheap and brightly coloured. Cheap and not cheerful, as the clothing manager calls it, out of earshot from the higher-ups, of course. Take what you need, Dave. Whatever you want, I can sign for it. There are cargo-style trousers with the side pockets, but none in black, only lighter colours and some funky camouflage designs. I've been using dark clothes so far, trying to keep hidden in the shadows. What do you reckon, Dave? About right? Yes, camouflage is the art of concealing personnel or equipment from an enemy by making them appear to be part of the natural surroundings. I stop and stare at him. That was the biggest speech I have ever heard him give. And he said it parrot fashion, reeling it off from memory. I go back to casually looking at the trousers. So were you in the army, Dave? Yes. He has already chosen black jeans and a very dark green top. He takes these and walks to the changing room, closing the door behind him. The conversation is over. I choose the same jeans as Dave had selected and start to get changed. My legs are soaked from the blood that has seeped through. I'm going to get some wipes to clean my legs. No response. I head into the health and beauty section and find the same wipes that Dave used. I clean my legs thoroughly and then put the new jeans on. I put several packs of the wipes into my bag. My trainers are ruined and I head back to the clothes section and find a pair of plain sturdy black boots. The explorer bag is quickly filling up. Dave comes out, dressed in the dark clothing. He looks awkward out of the Tesco uniform. He selects a leather belt from a stand and hands it to me before getting another and threading it through his belt loops. I do the same and put the belt on. Dave then tucks his top into his jeans, but I don't bother. I need a new bag, mate. I indicate the explorer bag and he nods before setting off to the sports aisle. I follow him and watch as he takes various bags off the shelf and checks them through. He settles on a Berghaus medium-sized rucksack with side pockets and a tight, elastic mesh at the front. Both have chest and waist straps. He hands me a dark blue one, and he chooses dark green. I transfer my stuff to the new bag. I watch as he puts the knives into the mesh pocket, blade first. He tests the elasticity and seems satisfied. Leaving the large, orange-handled one in the mesh, he draws the straight-bladed knife back out and carries it in his hand. Ready, mate? He shakes his head. Food. Fluids. And he's off again. I follow behind as he selects various items in the store, high-energy protein bars, glucose drinks, bottles of water and first aid kits. Each time he hands me some first and then puts the same in his own bag. Eventually, the bags are full with supplies. Food and fluids, as he called them. He seems ready to go. Then he stops and looks at me. We should eat now. Now he's off into the aisles, taking cooked chicken from the meat section, then packets of microwavable rice, and finally, tinned vegetables. I'm following behind him, taking the same things. I want to get going, but he seems to know what he's doing, and I did promise earlier that I would plan and prepare better. Perhaps he's right. There's no way of telling when the next meal will come. And we should eat now. We go through to the staff canteen area, and Dave takes plates and cutlery from the cupboards. He empties the contents of the packets onto a plate and starts digging in. We could heat them up in the microwave. There's still power. He shrugs and carries on. A short while later, we're outside in the rear compound walking towards the home delivery vans. Bags on our backs, axe in my hand, and Dave is holding the knife down by his side. We're both dressed in black, and I feel a bit self-conscious, imagining a rock soundtrack playing out. Yeah, very cool. Two supermarket workers getting away in a Tesco home delivery van. One of them is some kind of highly trained killer with possible autism. Chapter 14 We move off towards the double gates and they open on a sensor from the inside. We have to pause for a few seconds to let them swing out. It's still dark, but the sun will be up before long. 
I pull out of the gates and start crossing the car park towards the main road. Dave remains silent, his hands together in his lap as he stares forward. So, were you in the army for long? Fourteen years. Quite a while then. Did you go overseas much? I'm not allowed to say. Oh, right, of course. What part of the army were you in? I'm not allowed to say. Bloody hell, it feels rude to keep asking questions. He's obviously a private man, but the silence is uncomfortable, and I feel the need to fill it. I lived in the town too, but those things tried to get in my house, so I had to leave. My parents lived the other side of Littleton. I went there on Saturday morning, but they'd gone. They left me a note saying they were coming to look for me, so I came back, but I can't find them. The town is overrun, and I almost got caught a few times. Silence. My sister lives in London. She called my parents and said that she was locked into her flat. That's where I'm going, to try and find her. I heard on a radio broadcast that survivors should head to those Victorian forts on the coast. I've already met some other people and told them. That's where I thought we would go, to the forts. Silence again, and this time I leave it unfilled. On the motorway, I have to slow down to pass the wreck from Saturday morning. The woman's body is still there, and the male undead corpse is still half out of the upturned car. Dave looks at the wreckage as we go through. I saw that happen. I was going to my parents, and it flipped over right in front of me. The woman was still alive, but she died while I was helping her. Dave looks at me and nods, doesn't say anything, then looks ahead again. As daylight rises, we pass the shop where I met the Indian lady and the estate survivors. The cars are all gone, and the shop looks deserted. I slow down to look through the windows. The shelves all look empty. I guess those people took everything and got away. I hope they made it. I drive into the estate and stop outside the house. This time, I take the keys with me and lock the van up, feeling somewhat safer now that there are two of us. Dave gets out and follows me to the front door. My dad's car is still missing, and I get a horrible sinking feeling that they haven't been back. In the dining room, the note is where I left it. No signs of anyone being in the house since I left. Dave disappears off into the house and comes back after a few minutes. All clear, Mr Howie? Yeah, thanks, Dave. I feel an overwhelming sadness surging through me. They must be gone. Their note said they would come back here after checking at my place. Something has happened. I think of my parents being undead, an awful, slow, painful death, and then they become them. They might have been in that horde that chased me into the club during the night, or even been dispatched by Dave in the supermarket. The thought sickens me, and I sit down at the dining table. My parents are gone, dead, or maybe worse, if they indeed were undead, would they attack me if they saw me? Dave, did any of the other staff from work turn into those things? Yes. Did they try and come for you? Yes. Did they show any signs that they recognised you? No. That's it then. My parents would go for me. There is a deep pain inside me, and it won't go away. Memories from childhood flood into my mind. I think of special times that we shared, Christmas and the effort that my parents made when it was our birthdays. The retirement party we had for my dad, who then went back to work a few weeks later. He worked all his life, and even in retirement, when he should have been relaxing, he wanted to contribute. The hints they kept dropping me and my sister about marriage and babies and wanting to be crown parents. The pain is too much. They've gone, been taken away by those evil things. They tried to come and rescue me, knowing they were going into danger, knowing the risks, but they still tried. They are selfless and valiant people. The pain crushes my heart, but I can't break down here. This isn't the time. They were good people, decent, loving and nice. The undead have taken them from me. Even if I find my sister, no, 
when I find my sister, I'll have to tell her that they're gone. There is a vase of flowers on the table, selected and carefully arranged by my mother, showing pride in her home, the home they worked hard for. They're gone, and the undead have taken them. A rage starts to build in me. I think of Marcus and his fucked-up club. How dare he breathe the same air as my family? He isn't worthy of anything. Not life, not love. All around me are the things that they cherished. Photos of my sister and I adorn the walls. The ceramic pot I made in school and gave to them as a present is proudly displayed on a shelf. My mother even kept my old clothes in the loft. She was too nice to throw them out. The rage is building, and the hunger for revenge is consuming me. They are gone. The undead have taken them, have taken them away from me. The cold, hard fury cannot be ignored. This cannot be left. This must be done now. I go into the kitchen and pull out the knife drawer, slamming it onto the kitchen top. I look up and see a row of knives stuck on a magnetic strip on the wall. They were a retirement gift from my dad's place of work. Moulded high tensile stainless steel, bevelled grips with small black rubber inserts. One of them is a huge cleaver. We joked about mum using it on dad if she got fed up with him being at home. The thought of my parents drives me on, and I take the cleaver and head back out to the van with my axe. Staring straight ahead, eyes fixed, I get into the driver's seat and start the engine. The cleaver on the middle seat. Dave gets in without a word. He has two more knives from the same set on the wall, and both of them are long and straight-bladed. We stare at each other, then I face ahead and pull away, heading out of the estate and back onto the main road. One of those fucking things took my parents. I don't know which one, but I'll find it. There'll be a sign, some kind of aura, an evil presence. Somehow I will find the one that took them, and I will hurt it. I will kill it. I will kill all of them. I will purge that town and raise it to the fucking ground. Where now? Dave asks. Borough Fair. Okay. Chapter 15 Within minutes, we're back on the motorway, the engine screaming loudly as I ram the gas pedal down as far as it will go. The road is still clear, and I push the van hard. I barely slow down as we fly onto the junction. The main road, the roundabout, and then onto the high street. The horde is in that town. The pain is consuming me, and the need for revenge blots out all thought or reason. There is no other way. I want to see them suffer, burn, be ripped apart, and die horrible, painful, second deaths. I don't know if they feel pain, but I hope they do. I think of all the bad things I have seen. News reports of families torn apart by violence. Offenders getting away free because of a weak legal system. Not being able to exact revenge because the authorities say that vigilantism is wrong. But it isn't wrong. It can never be wrong. They hurt my family. They can't be arrested or tried in a court. Nobody will come along now and say nice things to calm my rage. Now there is punishment and I will deliver it, and if I can't, then I will die trying. I stop the van just before the precinct. The metal barrier is in the distance, and I can see the massed undead beyond it. I press the horn down and keep it held, and the long wail echoes off the buildings. The undead start toward me. It's daylight again, and they are slow now, shuffling along, barely at a walking pace. I want them now. I want them to be here so I can hurt them. But I wait, and I push my anger through that horn, my fist pressing into the middle of the steering wheel. I start to punch it, one fist after the other, rhythmic and constant. They're moving so slow. But I can wait. I will wait for them. The wait just increases the blind fury within me. Dave is saying something, but I can't hear him as the blood is pounding through my skull. What? Keep your space. Don't get drawn in. Keep moving. Strike and move. Keep a firm grip on your weapon. Aim for the head or neck. I stare at him and nod. Right. 
Here they are, pouring round the barrier, coming to me, coming to bite me, coming to eat me. I wait for more of them to get round. Then I stop the horn and start revving the engine, foot pushed all the way down. The engine roars. The engine is a warrior too. And it wants the blood. It wants to hurt and maim them. It's shouting at me, let me go, Howie, let me at them. I put my seatbelt on and see Dave doing the same. He looks at me, then back at them. He motions forward his hand and says one word. Now! I lift the clutch up and the engine surges ahead. It powers forward and I change the gears, gaining speed. We cannot be stopped. Nothing will stop us. We're coming for them. Coming to end them. The last few seconds before impact seems like slow motion. I see the undead coming forward, spittle and drool hanging from their mouths, dried and crusty blood all over them, their red staring eyes and limp arms hanging down. I notice a picture that has been stuck on the front of the radio, a young boy smiling, blonde hair and white teeth. I remember my family, my sweet, loving family, and that powerful surge of rage burns through me, like it did on Friday when I killed the first one with the hammer. At the last second, time seems to speed up, and we smash through the first rows of undead slamming into bodies. The speed sends them flying off to the left and right, and their heads get pulverised as they lean forward with their teeth bared. The van bursts them apart, driving us deeper into the crowd. Bouncing and jolting, we go over bodies, crushing them under the wheels. We destroy many in our path. Metallic thumps and bangs sound from the front as they're crushed. Some go spinning off into other undead, knocking them over. I keep my foot pressed down as we plough into the thickest part of the crowd. The front of the van slams them against the barrier, and we stop with a massive crash, jolting us both forward against our seatbelts. The impact is immense, and it causes pain to my chest and neck. I look ahead and see bodies of undead squashed between the van and the barrier, pressed like fruit. I had no idea that the human body could be compressed so much. We are at least one metre from the barrier, and there must be twenty undead squished in front of us. Dave is out of the door. I rip my seatbelt off and burst out too, the axe in my hands. There is devastation all around us. A large, thick, gory wake behind the van and bodies scattered everywhere, but there are more on their feet, coming towards me. Oh yes. Come on, my beauties. Come to Howie. As the first one lunges, I remember Dave's words. Strike and move. Aim for the head or neck. I slam the sharp side of the axe into a face, cleaving the skull. I step away and strike again, bringing the axe down over my head like splitting logs. But instead of a log, I split skulls, bursting them apart, almost cutting heads in half. I keep moving. They are slow and I am fast. I am death, and I have come for you. I dart forward and whip the axe at them, heaving away, cracking skulls and destroying them. The axe isn't sharp and will not slice into their jugulars, but it has weight. It has anger and fury behind it, and a thirst for revenge. The power compensates for the lack of cutting power. Instead of cutting them, I gouge them open, hacking the flesh apart as the axe is forced through them. More are coming now. I want them to come. I want all of them to come. There are no thoughts now. No rational thinking. Just strike and move. Strike and move. I keep going, and the rage that I had before is nothing compared to what it's like now. It was cold and seething, murderous and ready to plot and plan. But this is unleashed. Berserk, abandoned, fury, let loose, encouraged and allowed to explode. I twist the axe round and start using the blunt end, swinging out to the left and right, aiming for the side of their heads. A good impact, and they go straight over with a crushed skull. A lesser impact sends them spinning off. If they're not killed outright, they get up and come back. Good. I want them to come back. I want them to suffer. I've drawn them on towards the rear of the van. Dave is nearby, and I get a fleeting glance of him whirling and spinning through the undead with a huge wake of bodies left behind him. I keep on attacking them, moving backwards to draw them on, 
then darting forward and taking one out. My hands and arms are covered in blood. They're slick and wet, and my grip is failing. I can feel the shaft sliding under my hands. I clench the axe handle and step forward. A massive overhead heave, and I miss the head and hit the shoulder, forcing the axe down into the collarbone, almost severing the shoulder. I pull the weapon back, but the axe head is loose, rattling on the end of the shaft. I move back and throw the thing at the nearest undead. Eyes on! Dave shouts from my left. I look over and see that he has taken the massive cleaver from the van. He bends down and sends it spinning across the ground at me, aiming for a body lying a few feet away. I race forward and pick it up, staring at the shiny, massive blade. Grip it with both hands like a sword, he shouts, then turns and starts back into his group. I take his instructions and grip the large handle with both hands. Looking at the undead still massing and coming on, I move forward and slash at the closest one. The blade slices through his face like butter, effort hardly needed, but I drive too hard and the blade cuts down into his chest. I pull back and remember Dave going for their throats. I look to the next one and push the blade at the neck. The jugular opens and hot blood pours out. I keep going, dancing round them, stabbing and thrusting. I lack the finesse that Dave has, but sheer, blind, psychotic rage spurs me on. I move backwards. The building line is just behind me, and I look round and see a DIY shop just a few doors up. Oh yes, fucking yes. I run up, but the doors are locked. An undead comes at me. I slash at his neck, and as he bends forward, I go behind him and use his head to propel him forward into the door, smashing the glass pane. Then I pull him back and drive him forward again. The glass explodes and I pull him away. I kick at the frame and use the cleaver to clear away the shards. Then I reach in and unlock the door. It must be bolted on the inside. I kick at the middle and keep kicking until the door bursts open. I force my way inside and the alarm goes off instantly. But it's a mere distraction to me. The shop is a Viking wonderland. It sells heavy, sharp things. Weapons are everywhere. I take a sledgehammer and move back towards the door. The cleaver was good, but it doesn't satisfy my craving for revenge, and I don't want to be clinical or precise. I want to hack and destroy. The first undead is coming through the door. I take a huge overhead swing, and the head explodes, driving the body down into the doorway. I step back as another tries to push in. Again, I heave the hammer overhead and watch as the head explodes like a melon bursting apart. The door is only halfway open, and the two bodies have created a natural barrier. I go back into the shop, perusing weapons. The sledgehammer is good, but it will become very hard work. I select two lump hammers, big, solid lumps of metal on the end of short handles. I go back outside, clambering over the bodies. Undead are massing towards me, and with a hammer in each hand, I slam them in the face, like clapping my hands. The effect is amazing. The cheekbones are driven in, and I swipe away, one skull after another, and the rage builds in me again, now that I am back amongst them. Male, female, young, old, I don't care. I want them to die, and I want to destroy them. The hammers are good, but they are not killing them quickly enough, just knocking them over or off to one side. Back into the DIY shop, and in the corner, there is a brightly coloured display stand. A huge sign hangs over the top, offering a free demonstration for tree cutting this Saturday. Tree cutting? I go over and see a massive chainsaw resting on the display top with a long, fierce-looking blade, complete with big teeth. I pick it up and test it. Very heavy. There is a switch marked on off, and a long pull cord. I put the switch to on and pull the cord. The engine roars to life, but the blades remain still. There are two handles, one at front and one at the back. A lever is at the front, and I pick the chainsaw up and press the lever. The engine increases in pitch as the blades spin round. There is a pair of safety glasses next to the counter. I put these on and head out of the store.
An undead is at the entrance. I press the lever again and push the end of the blades into his chest. The blades bite instantly, ripping the rib cage apart, and I force the chainsaw forward a few inches, then back out. There is a gaping, ragged wound in him, and he goes down. I have to clamber over three bodies now, and once back out, I can see that more have massed. I move forward with the lever pressed down, keeping the chainsaw at head height, sweeping left and right, cutting through the undead. I drive forward into them, sweeping round in a circle. The magnificent machine powers through them, ripping through bone, tendons, sinews and flesh. The sprayback is immense, and within seconds I'm covered in bits of body. I lean my head back and roar, screaming at them to keep coming, and they do, pouring to their deaths, leaning in for the bite, and as I slice through their exposed necks, their ugly, distorted heads roll off. I can't stop. This is it. This is the destruction I have craved, and I don't see them as people now. They are undead. They are not male or female, not adults or children, but they are something else. A new species, like an evil entity sent to consume us, and I will fight them and destroy them. The chainsaw doesn't stop. It keeps hacking and cutting through the crowd. The weight is heavy and I am sweating, breathing hard, but the exertion is worth it, and the effort is rewarded by the flesh being eaten by the teeth of my spinning blades. Minutes pass, and eventually the chainsaw stops, the fuel spent. I move backwards and see what has been done. There are bodies and body parts scattered everywhere. The mess is an awesome sight. Not awesome like in a cool movie, It's awesome like something you can't otherwise describe. There is a long trail of broken and destroyed undead bodies leading from the DIY shop back to the Tesco van. The other side is even worse. Dave has easily killed three or four times the amount I took down. Exhausted, filthy but somehow satisfied, I walk back into the DIY store and take two new long-handled axes, Then go over to the Tesco van, ignoring the remaining undead. I climb into the driver's seat and sit slumped, looking down at the gore coating my clothes. Dave gets into the passenger side. He looks remarkably clean, save for some blood splatter on his hands and arms. He takes a pack of wipes out and starts the cleaning process. Hands, arms, face and then weapons. There are a couple of undead on both sides. We both reach out and pull our doors shut. I put the van in neutral and switch the keys off, then back on. Surprisingly, the van starts first time. The bodies have cushioned the van from any major damage. We sit there with the engine idling over and I take some wipes and go through the cleaning process too. Better? He asks. Much better. I reverse the van and drive out of town. I have a deep feeling of tiredness, but the anger hasn't gone away and it has not been exhausted. It has been quelled for a short time, driven back down inside me, but it will come back. I know that. This fury will never be stopped. We drive in silence to my parents' house, and I use the shower while Dave makes food. Then we swap. We put our clothes into the washing machine, then into the tumble dryer, and Dave checks the house, securing every door and window, drawing curtains and dropping blinds. He comes back into the kitchen. Sleep now? I nod. There are two spare rooms upstairs, so help yourself. He disappears, and I hear his footsteps on the ceiling above me. A few minutes later, I'm in the other spare room, collapsing on the bed, drained and exhausted. The last thing I remember before sleep pulls me under is the light disappearing. The electricity has gone off. Day 3. Sunday Afternoon. Chapter 16. Sitting bolt upright in bed with sweat pouring off me, breathing hard as my heart hammers in my chest. I was dreaming, but I can't remember what about. Something, an image, a feeling, but it flits away the more I try and grasp onto it. The light in here is soft 
filtered through curtains, giving the room a warm glow. Must still be daylight outside. Vivid images from the fight in Borough Fair's town centre surge into my mind. There were so many bodies left lying and broken, split apart, limbs and shredded carcasses, innards spilling out onto the pavement, and so much blood. The blood surprises me. I thought that the undead wouldn't bleed. If they died and then came back, then shouldn't they still be dead? The heart stops when the body dies. If the heart stops, then the blood cannot be pumped round the body, and if the blood cannot be pumped, then why are they bleeding so much? I saw Dave cutting throats open, severing the arteries, and the blood was spraying out everywhere. I was so shocked and hell-bent on revenge that I didn't really take in what was happening. But now, after a few hours' sleep, I think back to the way he moved and killed with so much finesse and precision. There was no way I could hope to ever be like that. But the axe was good, cleaving skulls open and chopping bits off all over the place, and the blood was coming out. It looked like blood too. Normal red blood, hot and sticky. What else did I use? Oh yeah, the sledgehammer. That was amazing, but really only a one-trick weapon. Great for an overhead smash into the skull to explode the head. I suppose it would be good for creating space. It could be swung around, but then it's too heavy and cumbersome and will cause the arms to tire quickly. The axe is lighter. Then there were the two lump hammers. Again, they were effective at one-on-one, or even a couple of them at a time, but against several undead, they lacked the range. The chainsaw was bloody amazing, really, truly amazing, and I regret not bringing it with us. A few people armed with chainsaws could destroy tons of undead, but again, they're heavy and too reliant on fuel. If one part breaks or jams, it would be rendered useless. No, unless we can find guns, then I will stick to the axe for hand combat. The thought of using the phrase hand combat shocks me. I'm a supermarket manager, not a soldier. What do I know about combat or fighting techniques? Dave, on the other hand, is not all he seems. He said he was in the army for 14 years, but he wouldn't say anything else about his time in the service. I've met loads of ex-service people. Quite a lot of them had seen action in the Middle East. Some had physical scars, wounds that were visible. Others had scars that weren't so noticeable. Post-traumatic stress disorder or other, that's what they call it. But Dave, he doesn't betray any feelings or emotions. The only time I have seen him give anything away was last night in the supermarket, when I told him he should get away from there. He clearly had nowhere to go, no family or friends. The thought of taking away his routine must have scared him. He could have run or even closed the doors. Every staff member is shown how to close and shut off the automatic doors, in case of emergency. Dave didn't shut them, though. He stayed on the shop floor. He even killed the rest of the staff as they were turned into undead. I wonder if any of them fought alongside him until they were taken down. Maybe Dave didn't hesitate, but killed them instantly. Routine must be important to him, as well as having someone in a position of authority, of perceived authority, anyway. Fourteen years of army life must have moulded him. But then, other long-serving army people I have known weren't like that. He's only been at the supermarket for twelve months, But even during that time, he would follow the same routine, getting to work precisely 15 minutes before his shift start time and being out and working exactly five minutes before his shift was due. We got back here in the early morning and it was obvious that my parents hadn't returned. That's when the rage came on me. I've never had any kind of feeling even come close to that before. I didn't even know that people could have such feelings. No, that's naivety. Serial killers and murderers must be driven by emotions like that. But then the word emotion doesn't feel right either. That wasn't an emotion like being sad or happy or like the hurt you feel after the end of a relationship. What I felt was something else. Something deeper. A base state of being. An instinct to exact revenge and hurt those that hurt me. Not with words, but with action. Self-reflection is uneasy at the best of times. Now it is almost impossible. In this warm, soft light after a decent sleep, 
and I can think rationally about all those people I killed. No, I mustn't think like that. They weren't people. They looked like the people they had been, but the body is just a carrier for the infection, an infection that makes them want to rip open human flesh with their teeth. They're driven to pass that infection on. This thought process has alarmed me. If they can bleed and what possesses them is an infection, then maybe they will recover. What if it was just a 48-hour bug? Jesus, they might recover of their own accord. And I've already slain shitloads of them. Plus, I burnt down a village. What will I say if they all go back to normal? Oops, sorry about that, didn't mean to cause genocide. I thought you were all zombies, but that was my mistake. Never mind, no harm done. Maybe there is a cure, an antidote or someone who is immune. But even if there is, what can I do? I must assume that this is here to stay. I have to stick with the original plan, find my parents and sister and get to the forts. There is a sudden pain inside me as I realise it's too late to find my parents. The fact they are gone hasn't registered or been accepted yet. With my heart feeling heavy, but my mind already racing, I get out of bed and cross to the window. Outside is lovely. It's mid-July and very warm. The air almost looks hazy with the scorching sun. I glance at my watch. It's almost 3pm. I've had a few hours of sleep, but my body is aching. Muscles are hurting from all of the exercise in the last day or so. That fight this morning has left me drained, and I just want to rest, sit down and watch old movies, drink tea and do nothing. I look at the light bulb. The light went out as I fell into bed, so the power must have gone off. I flick the switch several times, but get no response. The hallway light is the same. It could just be a fuse. I go downstairs and into the kitchen. Dave is sitting at the counter, drinking what looks like coffee. I cross to the fridge and open the door, but the light doesn't come on. Power's gone. How did you make the coffee, then? Gas. There is a saucepan on the gas hob, half filled with water. A plastic bottle of milk is resting in the washing up bowl, which is filled with water and ice cubes. The water in the pan is still very hot. I make coffee and lean against the counter. I feel spaced out, like there is no order or sense to my thoughts. Dave looks freshly shaven, his clothes tucked in and smart. I look down at myself, suddenly self-conscious that I'm standing here in just boxer shorts. I hardly know this man. We may have commenced war on a massed horde of evil undead together, but still, I shouldn't be walking around in my underwear in front of him. That just isn't right. Then I spot my clothes folded neatly on top of the tumble dryer. At least the clothes dried before the power went off then. Almost. I put them outside. What, in the garden? On the washing line? Bloody hell, Dave, thank you. Okay, Mr Howie. Dave, you don't have to call me Mr Howie anymore. Howie is fine. Okay. He won't call me Howie. I know that. I take the clothes and go into the lounge to dress. The thought of getting dressed in front of him feels weird. There is a road atlas on the shelf. My dad loved technology and would always have the latest gadget. New computer, latest phones. But despite all of that, he would lecture me that society has become too over-reliant on technology. It has its uses and should be enjoyed, but not taken for granted. I listened, but never really took it in. Looking at the atlas now reminds me of what a careful and prepared man he was. I take the atlas back into the kitchen and onto the countertop. I stand the other side opposite Dave and start to flick through the pages until I find the southeast. Brighton is east of here. London is north, about two hours on a good day. The roads should be clear and we could make good progress into the city. The radio message I heard said London was infested and to stay away. London is very densely populated. There must be millions of people living there and the infection would have spread like wildfire. It should be easy to get into the city, but getting through the city will be another matter entirely. Bloody hell, we need a tank. Dave? He looks up at me. Nothing. It was a stupid thought. No, maybe not. Where could we get a tank from? 
he doesn't even flinch. Salisbury? Where is that? I don't know, Mr Howie. Are they hard to drive? I don't have a licence. They must be hard. How about those armoured vehicles? APCs? Yeah, them. They must be like cars to drive? He shrugs. Do they have those APC things at Salisbury too? Yes. Okay, so we need to get into London to get my sister, but I heard an emergency broadcast that said London is infested and to stay away, so I reckon we should get to Salisbury, nick an APS and get going. An APC? What? You said APS, it's an APC, Armoured Personnel Carrier. Oh, right, sorry, we get an APC and try for London. I mean, I need to go to London. I didn't mean to assume that you were coming with me. I'll come. Great. So, Salisbury is here, I say, as I point to the area around Salisbury. And we are here. It should take us around two hours to get there, I think. And it's 3pm now. It gets dark at about half nine, so if we leave now, we should make it before nightfall. Okay. No questions, no speculation, not even any doubt. Just okay. We start getting ready, and I take some plastic carrier bags from a drawer and empty all of the perishable food into them. Then the tinned goods and anything else that can be eaten goes into the bags. I go out to the Tesco van, which looks a mess. The white front end is covered in blood and gore. The passenger side wing mirror is missing. Driving back, I didn't notice that. I open the rear doors and inside is spotless. The delivery manager maintained very high standards. Regular spot checks were carried out by the higher-ups and any discrepancies were dealt with severely. I put the food into the rear. Dave brings out bedding from the spare rooms and puts it in. He's also found a gas lamp from the garage. Why didn't I think of things like this? I said that I would plan and be more careful. I chide myself for not thinking of such simple things, and to make amends, I go back in and take some mugs and plates and add them to the pile. Within minutes, we are ready, and I take my two new axes and get into the cabin. Dave joins me with more knife handles poking out of his rucksack. It looks like he has pretty much taken all of the knives from the magnetic strip in the kitchen. I like knives. He must have seen me staring at them. Chapter 17 I start the engine and I'm about to pull off when I realise that I don't know my sister's address. Idiot. How can I not know where my sister lives? But then we have mobile phones and email, so we stay in constant contact. I never even thought to take her address. I rush back into the house and, by the telephone, is Mum's old address book. I remember this from when I was young, hard-backed and brightly coloured with flower depictions. Inside, there is a page for every letter of the alphabet. I flick through, seeing names crossed out and new ones added in as people have moved about over the years. The memory stings me, and I quickly flick to S. There it is. Sarah, London. I kiss the book and offer a silent prayer to my mother, still taking care of me, even now. Back outside and into the van, the book goes into my rucksack, and then I think better of it, and give it to Dave. Can you look after this, please, mate? My sister's address is inside, and I can't afford to lose it. Her name's Sarah. Her address is under Sarah London, if anything happens to me. He takes the book like I'm passing him a priceless antique, and he brings out a small hand towel from his bag, wraps the book, and places it gently into his bag. It feels wrong to be heading away from my sister. She could be in trouble right now. The note that Mum left said that she was locked in her flat and was safe, but a city like London is anything but safe. A Tesco home delivery van won't be enough. We need something strong and armoured. If a little coastal town like Borough Fair can amass a few hundred undead, then think what a city centre will be like. And why did they all huddle together in one place like that? In Littleton, they all grouped together in the village square. There were no other survivors that I was aware of. Maybe that was the last place they took a survivor down, so they stayed there, 
hopeful of another one. Or maybe a survivor got away from there and they stayed in the last place of contact. Like when I ran through the precinct into the club, they stayed outside those doors for a long time. But then in Borough Fair, it looked like more were joining the crowd. There must be something that passes between them, an alert state. So if one senses prey, then they all join in and the signal passes until they're coming from all around. This might be something we could use. Draw them together and create a safe passage, like the armoured security van driver. But on a bigger scale. A much bigger scale. How would we do that? I don't know the roads in London well enough to know where to draw them to. We could easily get ourselves trapped or stuck in a far worse situation if we start pissing about trying to be clever. They change during the hours of darkness, too. If we'd have gone back to Borough Fair during the night, we wouldn't have stood a chance. They're easy to kill during the day, slow with very poor reflexes, so that's the best time to move through them. Hide at night and move during daylight. There might not be enough time to get to Sarah today. By the time we have found a suitable vehicle and then got into London, it could be late evening. We don't have satellite navigation, so finding her address in the city will be hard enough. If only I could get a message to her, tell her to wait. Hang on. Satnav might work. The mobile networks are down, but do satnavs use the same network systems as mobiles? They all work off satellites and something to do with GPS. Maybe they're still online. I go through the radio stations in the van, flicking through all of the preset ones first and then manually through the frequencies. The message is gone. I didn't make a note of the frequency setting from the micro. I check FM, medium wave and long wave, but get only static, hissing or just silence. Before long, we're out into the countryside. Fields and meadows pass us on both sides, the empty road ahead stretching off into the distance. Every once in a while, we pass small dirt tracks that lead to buildings and farms set back from the road. We avoid the towns and keep to the country roads, checking the map every so often to be sure of the route. There are small clusters of houses nestled into the countryside, an idyllic home counties type of setting, worthy of picture postcards. We both munch our way through the perishable food, eating apples and bananas. I still feel spaced out and achy, but the steady driving and the normal activity of eating has helped to soothe my nerves. I was chucking the remains and waste out of the window to start with, but then I saw Dave collecting all of his waste in a separate bag. He kept glancing at me as I threw mine out of the window. Then he pointedly placed the waste bag in the middle of us. A simple action with one meaning. Sorry, mate, I wasn't thinking. I'm leaving a trail behind us, aren't I? Others would be able to follow us and know where we've been. I guess you learned that in the army. No? Oh, so why the waste bag? He looks at me, his face devoid of expression but somehow managing to imply that I'm a simple fool. Keep Britain tidy. He turns back to face the front again. I remain silent for a moment. Then I recollect my thoughts. Dave, what you said to me before about keeping a firm grip, strike and move, how do you know that stuff? And the way you use those knives, you must have studied martial arts or something. No. Where did you learn it then? He pauses for a few seconds, assessing the question. The army. Wow. Why did they teach you all that? I thought it was more about guns and stuff. Silence. Dave, the army has probably fallen. Christ, the whole country has probably fallen. Everything has bloody fallen, and those undead zombie things are everywhere. We even killed a shitload of them just a few hours ago. I'm sure that it will be okay if you tell me. I can't, Mr. Howie. Why not? I'm not allowed to say. What, you're not allowed to say why you can't tell me, or are you just not allowed to say anything? Yes. Clear as mud. We drive in silence. He clearly doesn't want to talk about his past, but I get the impression that he would tell me if he thought he was allowed. Someone has given him clear instructions of what he can and can't say, and he's sticking to them. There is a sudden cramping in my stomach, an urgent message being passed from bowel to brain. I have to go, and right now. There is an entrance to a lane just up ahead, 
Other than that, I will have to shit on the road. The verge on both sides is high and fenced off with big thorny bushes. The van stops just ahead of the lane, and I take a pack of wet wipes from my bag and get out of the cabin. Mr Howie? I can't wait. I lean my head back quickly to see Dave holding an axe handle out to me. I grab the axe and smile, before legging it down the side of the van and into the lane entrance. I go down a short distance, check all around me, all clear. Squatting down at the side of the tarmac, my trousers and boxer shorts around my ankles, there is immediate relief as my bowels open. My stomach keeps cramping as more poo gets spurted out, splattering the verge in tarmac. The smell is disgusting. My stomach must be upset from the extreme lifestyle of the last couple of days, plus the sporadic eating. I guess the copious amounts of fruit we just ate haven't helped matters either. Despite the smell and the thought of taking a crap in broad daylight in a country lane, the feeling of relief is amazing and I'm moaning with the pleasure. I almost sound like one of the undead. I keep groaning and then try to mimic the noises they make. Do they need to shit? I bet they just poo in their pants. Dirty undead. A noise behind me and I twist round. The lane goes downhill and the treetops almost meet above the middle of the road, making a tunnel. The lane is much darker. There is another entrance a few metres into the lane that was concealed by the bushes when I first looked. There is a noise coming from that direction. A movement. I grab at the wipes and start cleaning my arse. Unfortunately, this takes several wipes. I refuse to pull my trousers up with a dirty bum. I understand that we all have to make sacrifices and change our normal behaviour in this new world, but walking around with a shitty ass isn't one of mine. The sound is closer now. Ah, stuff it, I can give my ass a good clean later. I pull my trousers up and tighten the belt. The axe handle is wedged between my knees. A dog emerges out of the entrance. Black and white. One of those collie farm dogs. The dog has stopped and is staring at me, half hidden in the shadows. He is crouched low and looks like he's shivering. Poor thing. I wonder when he last had any food. I edge closer and speak in a nice soft tone. Hello, boy. Who's a good boy or girl? You're a good doggy. I love dogs. Always have done. We always had dogs when I was younger, ones from rescue shelters, so we had a good mix of crosses and mongrels. I'd love to get one now, but being single and working most nights is no good for a dog. As I move forward, the entrance comes more into view. The dog gives a soft growl and I stop. There is an undead further up behind the dog, a fat, middle-aged male. He has bushy grey hair and dark trousers tucked into big green rubber boots. He wears a light-coloured long-sleeved shirt and looks like a stereotypical farmer. He just needs one of those long sticks with a crook at the end. I imagine his wife making apple pies and Sunday roast dinners. Dave comes round the corner, obviously concerned that I've been gone for too long. I point at the entrance, guessing that he can't see them from where he is. He comes down further and joins me, then starts forward as soon as he sees the undead, knives ready and reversed in his hands. I don't think the dog will let you near him, mate. He looks down at the collie. The dog pulls his lips back and shows a row of large, sharp teeth. The undead farmer is shuffling slowly towards us. Let's try and get him out of that lane. His farm must be close. Dave looks at me. They'll have shotguns. He nods and walks a bit closer to the dog, who crouches lower and growls more. Dave stops and waits for the undead to make his way out of the entrance. The dog keeps glancing at his master, then moves position, edging closer to Dave, who backs away, just a little at a time. I go to the far left of the entrance. The dog goes to follow me, but Dave stamps his foot and brings the dog's attention back to him. This has got to be the slowest moving undead yet. He's inching along at a snail's pace. I drop the axe head onto the raised verge and lean on the handle. Despite the horrible circumstances, the lane is pleasant and quiet. Sunlight dapples through the canopy, causing shadows to dance across the surface of the road. It feels like it's getting hotter and there is no wind. The air is very close. The dog is panting. His big pink tongue hangs out of the side of his mouth. I go back to the van and open the rear doors. I take one of the bottles of water and a mug, and back in the lane, I fill the mug with water, placing it a few feet in front of the dog. 
We keep backing away, leading the farmer from the entrance and trying to get the dog close to the mug. Eventually, after what seems like hours, the farmer has come out of the lane far enough for us to get round. We both pull back further to create more space between us. The dog takes advantage of us moving away and laps at the water in the mug, his eyes never leaving our position. We both watch until the dog has its nose pressed into the mug trying to get at the bottom. Then the mug is knocked over and a tiny trickle spills out onto the road soaking into the hot surface. We move round behind the farmer until we're safely into the smaller lane. The earthen ground is rutted with wheel marks, compacted and dry in the hot weather. Wiping sweat out from my eyes as we move steadily uphill, high hedges on both sides preventing any view of the surroundings. The lane ends at a metal five-bar gate, which is wedged open. A rusty cattle grid lies just beyond the gate. The dark metal poles are evenly spaced, with weeds growing up between them. The gate leads on to a long driveway going downhill a few hundred metres to some buildings. Some of them are sheds and barns, long and low with corrugated roofs. There is plant machinery dotted about, things that farmers attach to tractors, I guess. One of the buildings looks like a normal house. Our raised position means that we can see the fields beyond the buildings. We both wait and stare at the view. Finally, Dave looks at me and nods, and we go through the gate and onto the driveway. There is a herd of black and white cows standing at the gate in a field adjacent to the buildings. As we get closer, I can see that the udders look full. I had heard that cows will get so used to the routine of milking, they will wait at the gate. I also heard that cows explode if they don't get milked, so I watch them as we pass, ready to duck in case of bovine explosion. The cows haven't been bitten, and the dog was okay too. The farmer would have access to all types of animals, but they look unharmed. I had thought of using rotting flesh or an animal carcass to lure them away in London, but it appears that the undead only crave human flesh. If we're going to use meat as a trap, then it has to be human meat, and alive too. I force the thought away, disgusted that I'm even thinking of it. There is a front door in the middle of the building. We circle the house, looking for other entry points or any signs of movement. The windows all have heavy net curtains inside in order to prevent the farmhands looking in the house, I guess. The front door is dark wood and inward opening. I slowly push the handle down and the door opens a fraction. I look at Dave, nod, and then slowly start to step forward. The axe bangs noisily on the lower half of the door, which remains closed. I look at Dave with an apologetic grimace. Sorry, it's a stable door. I reach in and unlock the bottom half of the door and we proceed. The floor is made from flagstones and there is a flight of exposed wooden stairs ahead of us. Dave taps me on the shoulder and motions for me to stay still. He moves off to the right into a doorway and is gone from view for a few seconds. He returns and gives me a thumbs-up signal, then motions with his hand towards the door on the left. He goes first, easing each foot down and treading carefully. He gets to the door, pushes it open and leans his head in. Without looking at me, he takes both knives in his left hand and raises his right to the side of his head. He makes a fist, then extends two fingers, giving me the V. He makes a fist again, and then extends one finger, pointing it into the room. Then a fist again, he extends a finger and points into the room, more off to the side this time. Then he makes a flat hand and runs it across his throat. Next, he extends all his fingers straight and reverses his hand so that the palm is facing towards the door. Then more palms and fingers are waved about. I have no idea what this all means. I think he is telling me that there is someone in there. The rest leaves me clueless. He looks back at me and I shrug my shoulders. And again, even though his face wears the usual devoid of expression look, I could swear he is wondering why he got stuck with me. He then points two fingers directly at his own eyes and motions for me to look. He eases back and I peek inside. There are two undead in the room. Ah, uh, so that's what he meant. Two of them. Then the hand across the throat must have implied they are dead. No, undead. I get it anyway. 
I don't know what the rest of the waving and pointing was about and make a mental note to ask him later. Mind you, he will probably say nothing again. One of the undead is a fat woman. A really fat woman. She must be the farmer's wife, all jolly and large, wearing a white apron over a flowery dress. The other undead is an adult male, wearing dirty and stained overalls tucked into rubber boots. They're standing side by side with their backs to the door, facing out the window. The farmer's wife has a huge chunk torn out of her meaty upper arm. Dried blood is spattered all down her dress. There are bloodstains on the male, but I can't see any injury from here. They're in the kitchen area, with a large dining table at one end, and are positioned in front of the sink. There is another closed door opposite me. There must be more rooms beyond it, as the house extends further than the size of this room. I ease back, and gently pull the door closed. Dave motions with his head for me to follow him, and he starts climbing the stairs. I climb up behind him, looking back at the kitchen door to make sure that I closed it. Dave has stopped, and I walk into the back of him, my head nudging his backside. Sorry, I whisper. He stays still for a second, doesn't look back, and then carries on going up. I wait for a gap to form between us and then start to follow him again. There is a corridor at the top, leading left and right. All of the doors are closed. Dave motions for me to stay put, then goes left, gingerly working his way down the corridor. I watch how he walks. Each foot is swung slow and purposefully, the heel going down first in an almost exaggerated manner. Then he slowly moves forward and puts his weight onto the front foot, then repeats the movement in complete silence. At the first door, he stops and listens, craning his head, and then leans in closer until his ear is almost touching the door his mouth open. He eases the door open, steps inside, and is back out within seconds. He repeats the action until all of the rooms on that end are clear. Then he creeps back to me and motions for me to move forward. I think he wants me to check my end. I start forward a few steps, copying his movement and putting my heels down first. It seems to take ages to work my way down. At the first door, I stop and listen, but I can't hear anything above my heart hammering away on my chest. I lean in to the first door, but still can't hear anything. I take hold of the handle and twist it back. The handle squeaks really loudly and I stop twisting. I look back at Dave, who nods for me to carry on. I keep twisting the handle, which sounds like it's screaming in protest. The door suddenly gives, and I push it open too fast, almost tripping in and banging the axe against the frame. This time, I don't look back. I'm too embarrassed to face him. I know that his face will be blank, but he still manages to convey a message through that vacant gaze. I peer into the room. It's all clear. I move off down the corridor, treading carefully and trying to show that I can do this too. At the next door, I grasp the handle and hold my breath as I twist. Silence. I breathe a sigh of relief and start to push the door open, which creaks loudly on the hinges. For fuck's sake, this is a conspiracy. How did he get all of the silent handles and doors? I keep pushing slowly, the hinges creaking and groaning. I stop. Pushing slowly is making it worse. If I push it open quickly, the hinges won't grate so much. I heave with force to a cacophony of metallic screams. At least the room is clear. The final door is facing the corridor, and again I take hold of the handle and push the door. It opens into a large bathroom. White tiles, white bath and white shower curtain around the bath. Nice and bright, apart from the large pool of blood on the floor. There is an undead female standing in the middle of the pool of blood. She is dressed in a white nightdress. She is fat. Incredibly fat. Quite possibly one of the fattest people that I have ever seen. She must be the farmer's daughter. The white nightdress has thin sleeves, which only serve to accentuate the rolls of fat on her upper arms. She has very long, dark hair, and there is a wooden-handled hairbrush tangled in her flowing locks. She slowly turns round to face me, and I see the red bloodshot eyes. At first I am puzzled, as I can't see a wound on her, but there is blood everywhere, and it's also soaked into the lower part of her nightdress. Her wrist has been bitten, 
deeply, flesh torn away. There is a gaping hole. The injury must have opened an artery. I look back at Dave and raise my hand to the side of my head, making a fist. He nods. Then I extend one finger and point into the room. Again, he nods. Then I puff out my cheeks, hold my arms out, and waddle slightly on the spot while motioning to the door behind me. He just stares at me. I keep waddling on the spot, holding my arms out and pretending to rub my big belly. Dave looks so serious, and, after the tension of creeping down the corridor, I let go and start giggling like a schoolboy. I then pretend to brush my hair and extend one finger and point it into my pretend hair. Within seconds, I'm trying to stifle my laughter, but the undead farmer's daughter starts waddling towards the door, and I back away. She's taller than me, and the girth of her is amazing, puff cheeks making her mouth look small and pouty. I back off down the corridor, still trying to stop myself laughing. She makes it to the doorway and gets stuck face on, too fat to get through. She keeps pushing forward, though, grunting and straining against the effort. That's it. I'm gone. Tears of laughter are falling down my face and I'm leaning against the wall. All of the stress of the last few days have built up and the sight of the fat undead unable to walk through the door has finished me off. I try to be quiet at first, but knowing that we have to be silent makes it worse and I can't stop myself from howling. Within minutes, my stomach is hurting. I manage to get myself under control, then look back at her. She has wedged herself into the doorway now. Her stomach is pushing through, but her shoulders and arms can't fit, and she's sort of leaning back and trying to get through belly first. I'm off again, sliding down the wall onto the floor. The laughing is hurting, but I can't stop. I try to look at Dave, but the tears have misted my eyes. I imagine him standing there, stony-faced. It takes many minutes, but eventually I get myself under control and get back up. Dave is standing there, impassive as ever, but I swear there is a glint in his eye. We make our way down the stairs and stare at the kitchen door. There was no sign of a gun cabinet anywhere upstairs. The only place left to check is the kitchen and the room on the other side. Well, what do you reckon? We could lead them out again? Dave nods and I check my watch. It's gone five already. Shit, we really have to get going. Okay. He walks straight into the kitchen, disappearing round the door. Two loud thumps follow within seconds. I walk in and see both undead on the floor. The farmer's wife is almost decapitated, the white spinal column showing through her severed neck. Dave reaches over and pulls the male undead on top of the farmer's wife, showing his OCD for tidiness. The humour is fully gone from me now. The brutal yet reserved nature of this man is staggering. His mind must be so straightforward when he's completing a task, whether it's filling the shelves at Tesco or severing the head of a zombie farmer's wife. Dave has positioned the bodies now so that the blood flow from the farmer's wife soaks into the male undead, who is in turn dripping his blood onto her dress. The door leads into the utility area which houses an old stained kitchen top with a deep white ceramic sink. There are dirty pairs of rubber boots up against the wall and overalls hanging from rails. There are two washing machines labelled House and Farm. There is a back door to the right. To the left is the promised bounty, a large metal cabinet fixed on the wall, complete with a massive padlock hanging from a clasp. The padlock has a thick metal loop and the clasp has multiple strong rivets securing the cabinet. Dave joins me and I point at the cabinet. I bet the farmer has the key in his pocket. We start searching the area, checking drawers and the pockets of the overalls. We find keys, but none of them fit the padlock. I pull at the padlock in the vain hope that he left it unlocked. The padlock is at head height. I take a step back and reverse the axe so that the blunt end will be used. Watch out, mate. Five minutes later and I'm out of breath. The metal casing is dented and buckled, but the padlock is holding fast. I try wedging the blade of the axe into the gap of the cabinet door, but I can't get enough leverage. Fucking thing. Any suggestions, mate? I look round, but Dave is gone. The back door is open, and I walk over to look out. Dave is walking back towards the farmhouse, holding a sledgehammer and a metal spike with a flat end. He holds the flat end between the gap of the padlock and clasp, then hands me the sledgehammer. The spike isn't that big, 
If I miss, I could break his arm or crush his hand. Let's swap. We move places and I hold the spike. The area is confined and I have to stand close to the cabinet. I want to move back and extend my arm, but it's too cramped. Dave swings the hammer and hits the spike with expert precision. It jams in and starts to buckle the clasp out. A few more hits and the clasp comes away. I pull my arm back and rub my hands together. He didn't hit me, but the vibration still sent shockwaves up my arm. Dave opens the cabinet door. There are three long shotguns, easily recognisable with two barrels and big brown bases. There is also a long camouflage bag in the cabinet. Dave takes this out and lays it on the work surface. A long zip runs the length of the bag. Dave tugs this down and pulls out a long wood and metal rifle. The barrel looks very slim compared to the shotguns. There is a bolt sticking out of the metal frame above the trigger. There is a separate compartment in the bag, and Dave takes out a scope and another bag containing oils and what look like cleaning materials. What is it? Lee Enfield point three zero three bolt action rifle. Is that good? Yes. Within seconds, the gun is separated into parts, Dave's hands working like machines. He checks the separate sections, then puts it back together. Then he pulls the bolt back several times and listens to the sound. Satisfied, he turns to the shotguns and takes them out of the cabinet, laying them on the worktop. Two of them have barrels side by side. The other one also has two barrels, but one on top of the other. They're heavy and feel alien to hold. I push the wooden end of one into my shoulder and look down the barrel. There are two triggers, one in front of the other. I guess it's one trigger for each barrel. There is a lever where the metal barrel meets the wooden bit. I push this over and the shotgun bends in the middle. I remember that shotguns have cartridges, not bullets. The cartridges must just slot in the holes. Close the barrel and pull the triggers. I've seen it done on television and movies and it looks simple enough. There are boxes of bright red cartridges in the cabinet. They are marked 12 gauge. I've heard of that, but don't know what it means. Something to do with the size of the shell or the little pieces inside? Dave has found a shoulder strap for the rifle and has fitted it on, checking the length and making adjustments until he seems satisfied. I guess he has chosen the rifle then. After my debacle in the corridor upstairs, he probably wouldn't trust me with a paintball gun. He next takes a box of shiny brass bullets, picks up the shotgun with the two barrels on top of each other, and heads out of the back door. I take the other two shotguns and boxes of the shiny red cartridges and follow him out into the bright sunshine. He stops in the middle of the central yard area. Outbuildings are on both sides, and there is a large open-sided barn ahead of us, with a field on the other side. I watch as Dave holds the rifle and looks down the sights, aiming into the empty barn, he pulls the trigger and listens to the noise. I'm sure they call it dry firing. Dave takes a strip of bullets, all stuck together in a line, and presses them into a hole in the top of the gun. Then he raises it to his shoulder and pulls the bolt back and forth once. He aims into the barn and fires. The sound is really loud, and I was expecting him to be jerked back from the recoil, but he hardly seems to move. He quickly slides the bolt and a shiny bullet case springs out. He fires again and repeats the action until the bullets are all gone. The sudden percussive bangs sound out into the quietness of the farm. He lowers the rifle so that it's pointing into the ground and turns round to face me. You try. I take the rifle and he shows me how to pull the bolt back and push the strip of bullets in, then how to use the bolt to get the first bullet ready. He pushes the butt of the rifle into my shoulder and extends my left hand, so it's holding the rifle on the wooden frame underneath the barrel. He then aligns my finger to the trigger and steps back. Squeeze gently. I pull the trigger. The recoil feels awful, jerking my shoulder back with a violent push. I have no idea where I'm aiming for. I do the bolt thing and try again, repeating the action. The recoil frightens me and I feel myself bracing in readiness. I end up closing my eyes. I fire three times and hand the rifle back, trying to do what he did and point the rifle down to the ground. I'm no good at it, mate. You use it. We'll just waste bullets if I keep trying. He nods and picks up one of the shotguns, 
breaks it and pushes a red cartridge into each hole, slamming the barrel closed. He steps forward and again raises the gun to his shoulder. His finger pulls the first trigger, then drops back and pulls the second one. Both times there is a loud bang, but he hardly moves from the recoil. I pick up another shotgun and copy his actions, breaking the gun, pushing the red cartridge in and snapping it closed. I brace my feet and fire. The first blast feels almighty and slams me backwards. I'm more prepared for the second barrel and the recoil doesn't feel so bad. I turn round and see Dave coming back out of the house carrying more boxes of shotgun cartridges. There are enough for me to keep practicing with and so I keep going, breaking, reloading, snapping back, fire, fire and repeat. Soon my ears are ringing from the noise and the ground is littered with spent casings. I feel a tap on my shoulder and see Dave pointing off to the side. There is a male undead coming out of one of the outbuildings, drawn by the noise and action. He's also fat, but this one clearly works and has big meaty shoulders and arms. I look at Dave. I thought farmers led healthy lives. He just shrugs and takes the rifle back out of the bag, pushes in another strip of bullets and raises it to his shoulder, aiming at the fat undead. He fires, and the undead is thrown backwards, hitting the side of the building and slumping down. There is a small hole in the front of his forehead, but the back of his head is spread across the peeling boards, brain and bits of flesh dripping onto the undead's face. Shit, I've never seen that before. I've just watched a man being shot in the head. My heart is racing and I feel weird. We've killed countless with hand weapons, but nothing like this. It was so easy. He just lifted the gun and pulled the trigger. For the first time in my life, I realise why firearms are so talked about. Their power is staggering. I've watched hundreds of war films and seen news reports of war footage, but I guess that I became desensitised over the years. It was just make-believe or footage from somewhere far away. The sheer brutality of it. Point and shoot and you make someone die. I'm suddenly very uncomfortable here and I want to leave. I want to be back in the safety of the van and moving away. Loaded down with weapons, we head back down the lane, stopping halfway so that I can hop into the bushes and open my bowels again. Chapter 18 we're both hot by the time we get back to the van. Dave looks a little rosy in the cheeks, but I'm melting and sweat is coming off me in buckets. We put two of the shotguns in the rear. The other one and the rifle go in the cabin with us. I start the engine and pull away. The van has air conditioning, and a couple of minutes later we're enjoying icy cold air drying our sweat. I want to eat, but my stomach is still gurgling away, so I just drink lots of water instead. The shotguns are heavy and cumbersome. The rifle is okay, and Dave handles it beautifully, but I won't be fast enough to keep breaking it open and loading it if we get stuck in a group of fast-moving undead. There must be a way to carry a shotgun, and the axe at the same time. I think of ways to adapt the bag so I can hold one of them, but they are both too long and will fall out. I imagine somehow fitting the axe head to the end of the shotgun so I can fire, then reverse it and chop them. I wonder if anyone has invented one. I could have patented it and made a fortune selling it to the crazy survivalists who kept going on about the end of the world. Mind you, they weren't so crazy, were they? Are they feeling self-righteous and pious, walking around their communes, patting each other on the back? Maybe one of them even started it. A mad scientist, a fundamentalist, end-of-the-world theorist, doing it on purpose to prove they were right, cleansing the earth of all the sin while they sit back and gloat at the genocide they've created. Bucking fundamentalists. They're just mentalists, no funder about it. We're in a town. I was too busy thinking of my new shotgun axe invention to realise we were out of the country. I was just following the road. The town is big and looks a bit grimy, and according to the map, it must be Portsmouth. I've been here a few times, the old part of Portsmouth, with the historic ships. It is nice, but the rest looks horrible, with old grey buildings and graffiti everywhere. We used to come shopping here, and I've been for a few nights out with friends, but everyone seems so aggressive and angry. 
blokes with tattoos and earrings and barely clad women with scraped back hair, big hoop bangles and mouths like sailors. Portsmouth is just a small city in the home counties. I could never understand why they all tried talking like mockney Londoners, walking about with bandy swaggers. We keep to the outskirts and use the outer roads to head towards Salisbury. I should have been paying better attention and avoided the city area. We're on a wide road with crappy looking shops on either side. The metal shuttering on some of them has already been forced open or wrenched off. There are windows smashed and debris litters the place. There are people here too, going in and out of the smashed windows, taking armfuls of gear and walking into the next one. As we move further into the city, we see more signs of civil breakdown. There are bodies scattered, lying in the road, also abandoned and burnt out cars and vans. It looks like a riot has taken place. Some of the bodies are clearly undead. Some are not so obvious, and a few look like normal people. A scattering of the vehicles we pass are still smouldering with thick black smoke. The hot summer air stinks of burning rubber and chemicals. Dave takes the rifle and pushes in a fresh string of bullets, then rams the bolt and breaks the shotgun, loading in two cartridges. I now wish that I had brought the other shotgun in the cabin. Places like Portsmouth were always on the brink of civil collapse anyway. Hard places full of hard people. God only knows what they'll be like now. Dave pulls his Tesco fleece out of the bag and puts it on. It's roasting weather, and I can't understand why he's doing that. He zips it, and then loads more of the ammunition clips into the pockets of the fleece. Next, he takes an empty plastic bag and puts shotgun cartridges into it. He leans over and threads the handle through my belt, tying them off. He makes a small, hand-sized hole in the top of the bag. I look down at the bag and feel for the hole with my left hand. We stay silent and look at the carnage around us. We're going much slower now. The road is littered with bodies and objects. There is no sign of any people now. It's just quiet and empty. I'm cursing myself for coming this way. There's a concrete footbridge going over the road ahead of us. The debris is stacked either side of the road, forming a narrow gap. As we pass into the shadow of the bridge, the top comes alive with people leaning down over the barrier. Rocks and stones are launched down, thudding into the bonnet. I accelerate and push through the tiny gap. I can hear the sides being scraped by objects as we force the van through. Loud bangs and thumps sound all around the van, and I put my foot down, coming out the other side. A few more objects are thrown, but bounce away. Thankfully, the windscreen is intact. I can see young children jeering and waving their arms in the air as we leave the bridge behind us. We need to stay on the main road to go round the city, but there is a barricade ahead of us. Vehicles have been parked end on end, then more stuff has been piled on top of the vehicles. Large refuse wheelie bins, sofas, beds, cabinets and all manner of furniture. The barricade is over head height and there is no gap through. In front of the barricade is a huge crowd of undead. There must be thousands. They stretch back well away from the actual barricade and are spilling out round the sides. The only choice is to go left, which takes us more into the city centre. And even that will be a squeeze though. There is barely enough room between the edge of the crowd and the building line. I bring the van to a stop. We're trapped between going back under the bridge and risking the missiles, or going ahead through that lot. The van is strong, and they are slow-moving undead, but if they mass in front of us, there will be no way through, and too many to go over. I look back at the bridge and see children spilling down both sides onto the pavement. They're running towards the van with more missiles in their hands. Shit, look at that lot. Fucking kids. Dave leans forward to peer into the wing mirror on his side, then he grabs the shotgun and is out of the van, moving off to the side. You can't shoot kids! I yell after him. He raises the shotgun up and aims towards them. If he fires, he could kill a child and alert that horde to our presence. Dave! No! I bellow. He stays still, holding the shotgun into his shoulder. I watch the youth slow down as they get closer, calling out to each other and pointing at Dave. Then the momentum is gone and they turn around and run back towards the bridge. Where are their parents? Why are they out in this? They should be behind that barricade. Someone has built it, and I can only guess there is a safe place behind it. Dave, 
There are doors in the building up from the barricade. Maybe we can get through. He shakes his head at me. We'll lose the vehicle and weapons. We can't stay here. We'll have to try and get through them quickly. A door opens from a house just a short distance up from the barricade. There is a small, clear area around the door, just a few metres before the closest undead. A woman is being pushed out. There are men holding her arms and pushing her from behind. She's screaming and struggling violently. She gets thrown out and sprawls on the ground. Then she leaps up and runs back at the door as it closes. I can hear her screaming and pounding on the door from here. The closest undead have noticed and are heading towards her. She has no weapons or any way to fight them off. Fucking hell, she'll get torn apart. She's thrashing her arms at the door, screaming and begging to be let back in. I don't know what she's done, but that is wrong, just plain wrong. We can't just leave her. I put more cartridges into the plastic bag and grab the shotgun. As I get out of the van, I break the shotgun as I walk over, but Dave has already loaded it. I slam the barrel shut and raise the gun to my shoulder. Dave, you go for her, I'll draw them away. Oi, over here, come over here. I keep bellowing out as Dave loops round behind me to the right. Just don't shoot me, Mr Howie. As if I would. I can't move left as the massed horde are in that direction and are starting to turn this way. Dave has gone right, so I must keep going forward. How far away do I have to be before I can shoot them? A shotgun has pellets and they spread. If I shoot now, I could hit her. I stop, unsure of what to do. Come right, shoot into the crowd. I move around, following a narrower path than Dave. I keep heading forward, but off to the right. Some of the undead closest to her are drawing away, heading towards my direction. I'm yelling at the girl to stop shouting and be quiet, but she doesn't hear me. There are still a few near to her, getting closer. She's still banging on the door and screaming, which is drawing their attention. Stop screaming! Stay quiet! A parade square voice from Dave. I look over, amazed that such a quiet man can produce such a noise. It does the job, though. She turns quickly and looks to Dave, then me. I shout over to her. Stay still and be quiet. Let me draw them off. She looks terrified and I don't blame her, really. Now I'm calling out again and trying to draw them off. Most have followed my voice, but a few are still shuffling ever closer to her, fixed on their prey. The woman is off to my extreme right. Several of the undead have staggered out in front of me, only a few metres away. The rest of the horde is behind them. Now, Mr Howie! I pull the first trigger and watch as the first undead is blown away. Then I move the barrel slightly and pull the second trigger. An undead is taken off his feet, hammering back into more behind it. I repeat the action that I learnt before. Lever, brake, cartridges out, cartridges in, closed, raise and fire. I don't notice the recoil this time, or the noise. I just see bits of undead body flying off as the pellets strike them at such close range. The effect is devastating. I move back and keep drawing them away from the woman, but an undead is suddenly at my right. I reverse the shotgun and slam the butt into his face and he staggers back as Dave steps behind him and slices through his jugular with a knife. The rifle is on his back, hanging from the strap. I repeat the action over and again, clearing space and blowing holes in undead bodies. I glance right and can see Dave spinning through the remaining undead who are almost at the woman, his knife slicing necks, severing arteries and spraying bright red blood across the pavement. I reload and notice that the cartridges are the same colour as the blood. An undead goes down just as I fire. The pellets spread out and knock several undead over behind him. Beautiful. Dave is at the woman now and is saying something to her, but she seems frozen to the spot, looking down at the bloody bodies lying at her feet. I start over to their location, treading carefully over the bodies. Then the door opens and a man reaches out and grabs the woman by the hair, pulling her back in. Dave lunges forward as the door is pushed closed. He wedges himself into the gap and forces his way through. The door slams shut behind him. Shit. Dave, where are you? 
Some of the horde are getting closer, and I reload and fire at them, sending them spinning away. I get to the door and use the butt to hammer at it. Dave, open up! A woman screams from inside, then I hear muffled thuds, voices yelling in pain and violence, then the sounds drop to silence, and the door swings open. The room looks like it was a front room, but stripped of furniture, and now with several adult males lying on the ground in large pools of blood from the deep cuts to their necks. What the fuck? I stare aghast between the bodies and Dave standing there like nothing has happened. They tried to grab me. Jesus, are they all dead? He calmly looks around at the bodies, then back up at me. Yes. The woman is cowering at the far end of the room, her hands covering her face. Another door opens, and she runs out of the room we are in, the door slamming behind her, leaving us alone with several dead bodies. Jesus, Dave, did you have to kill all of them? They kept coming at me. The horde are only metres away now. Fuck it, let's go. We start moving back to the van, just as it starts reversing away from us. Bollocks, I left the keys in it. The van stops and I can hear the engine being restarted. The little fuckers are trying to steal it and have stalled it. Thieving little shits. We run forward and I'm shouting for them to stop. The van starts pulling back again. There are kids on the bridge, waving and cheering. Dave stops and raises the rifle. In one fluid movement he fires at the van and my heart misses a beat thinking he has shot a child. A thieving little shit, but still a child. The front driver's side tyre blows out and the van drops down a little. He then slams the bolt and shoots again. The passenger side tyre deflates. The van then stops and three children get out and start running away. Dave immediately raises the rifle and takes aim. No! He pauses for a second and drops the rifle down, then looks back at me. They're just kids, I shout in horror. Okay. Fuck, this man is cold. I swear he would have shot them as they ran away. The front tyres are blown out and the van is resting lower. Grab the stuff, we'll have to run for it. We won't get more than a few yards in the van with both tyres gone. Cartridges and ammo are shoved into the rucksacks. Dave goes round to the rear as I pull my rucksack on, fastening the waist and chest straps. The axe is there, but I can't carry it and two shotguns. I take the axe and drop the shaft down between my back and the bag. The large metal head catches on the top of the bag and holds steady. I tighten the chest straps, drawing it closer to my body. It might be cumbersome, but it's better than leaving it here. Dave is back with the other two shotguns. The rifle is strapped to his back over the rucksack. He breaks both shotguns, shoves cartridges into the holes and slams them closed. We move round to the front of the van. The immense gathering of undead are nearly all turned and shuffling in our direction. If we go back, we'll get brained by rocks and missiles from the bridge. To the right, there is a row of shops and stores already looted and smashed up. The windows are all smashed out and the doors are hanging off. We run towards them, sprinting as fast as we can with our heavy loads. As we reach the first door, Dave stops and turns back to the crowd. You check, I'll hold. I run through a hair salon, big chairs facing cracked mirrors, combs and brushes on the floor. A small sink has been smashed off the wall and is lying cracked in two parts. In the rear rooms, there is a back door made from solid wood. I pull the bolts back and try to heave it open, but it has been locked with a key and will take too long to break through. No good. I run out and into the next one. Dave moves down and takes a kneeling position in the doorway, shotgun aimed into the horde. The stores are blockbusters, and the shelves are completely stripped, which strikes me as odd. The DVDs aren't in the display boxes, but they have taken the discs from behind the counter too. A mental image strikes me of some feral kids sitting in a room matching the discs to their cases. The back door is open, hanging on one hinge. Someone has taken the time and effort to batter it open. In here, Dave! He comes through, trying to close the front door behind him, but it's too badly damaged and won't shut. He grabs at the heavy shelves, trying to drag them to the doorway, but they're fixed to the ground and don't budge. He gives up and joins me at the back. 
This area is the same as the front, with litter and debris everywhere. A small road leading left and right. The back of a factory building is across the road, presenting a solid brick wall all down the road. We head left and keep moving. We follow the road as it bends to the right into a residential area of small terraced houses. A cheap rental area, already rough and grotty anyway, and looking even worse now. There are small streets leading off to the left. They must loop round the back of the barricade, and seeing as Dave has just killed several of them, I think we should try and avoid it. We keep going until we have passed several of the side streets, then we turn left and head down one of them. We get about halfway down and hear a loud bang from behind us. Dave instantly drops down and gets behind the back of a parked car. I look around to see a group of men running in our direction. One of them is holding something in his hand. Another loud bang and I see his arm is jerked up. I drop down and get behind the car with Dave. Fuck, they've got guns! Fucking handguns! Where did they get them from? Dave leans the shotgun against the back of the car and pulls the rifle around. He chambers a bullet and raises the rifle to his shoulder. As he stands up, I can see the group through the car windows. Dave fires and the lead man with the handgun is jerked backwards and drops to the ground. The others scatter into the road, dodging behind parked cars. Dave pulls the bolt and steps out into the road, the rifle darting back and forth as he scans the area. They're shouting to each other with loud, panicked voices. The man is still down, unmoving. Dave starts walking back towards their direction. A head pops up and Dave fires. I see the head explode from here, blood and matter spraying out as he's flung backwards against another car. His body slumps down. Dave rams the bolt and keeps moving. His movements are fast but controlled. The rifle looks steady in his hands. Go down the other side! Dave motions with his left hand towards the first man we shot, indicating for me to head down the side we just came up. I put one of the shotguns next to the one Dave left and start moving down. My chest is heaving. I can feel my hands shaking. I try to copy his stance and keep the shotgun raised to my shoulder, but I keep low. I'll kill you all! Dave bellows out in that drill sergeant voice again. I'll kill all your families, your wives and your children! They starburst out and start running back, shouting to each other. Dave drops one, shooting him in the back and he sprawls on the ground. Please, please don't shoot, asks a pleading voice in front of me. I look down and see a young man cowering in the gap between two cars. He's on his knees and his hands are covering the back of his drop-down head. He keeps looking up at me, tears falling down his cheeks. Please, mate, please don't kill me. Dave is there, standing behind him, the rifle aimed at his head. Are you armed? Dave demands from the cowering man. Please don't shoot, please. His voice is begging and pleading. Dave kicks him hard in the back, knocking him forward onto the ground. Are you armed? No, no, I'm not, I, I swear. Hands on your head, interlock your fingers. Please, please. Dave kicks him again. Do it now, hands on your head, interlock your fingers. The man responds, quickly putting his hands to the back of his head. Stand up, slowly. Oh fuck, please don't, please don't. He slowly stands up. He's just a skinny kid, maybe 18 years old. There are tattoos up his arms and on his neck, the obligatory earring hanging from his ear. Dave looks at me and nods firmly towards the boy. I shrug my shoulders, not understanding what he wants me to do. Would you search him, please, Mr. Howie? Oh, right, of course. Dave steps forward and pushes the end of the rifle into the boy's neck, which sets him off whimpering again. He squeezes his eyes shut and stands quivering. I step forward and start patting him down. He's only wearing tracksuit bottoms and a t-shirt, and I'm finished in seconds. Check the waistband, please, Mr. Howie. I run my fingers round the waistband. He's clear. I try to sound military, but I just feel silly. Move! Dave pushes him in the back, over to the side of the pavement. The boy turns and Dave shoves him hard against the wall and then nods at me. All yours, Mr Howie? All mine? What am I supposed to do with him? Er, uh, 
where are you from? What? He stammers, still terrified. I said, where are you from? Carter Street. Is that where the barricade is? Yes, please don't kill me. I didn't want to come, but they made me. Who made you? My dad. That's his brother, my uncle. Who is? The boy nods at the body on the ground, the one that Dave shot first. That's your uncle? Yeah. Who's your dad? John Jones? He says it like it means something. Who is he? Everyone knows him. He runs the area. He's the boss. The boy's tones grow more confident. What does that mean? Everyone knows him. Even the police leave him alone. And you're his son? Yeah. So he sent you after us? Yeah. Why? Because of what you did. He's staring at me now. The confidence is coming back. What did we do? You killed his mates. No one does that. His mates? Oh, you mean the men in that room? We were trying to help that woman. Why was she pushed out? She didn't do as she was told. Dad said we got to keep a firm grip of them. What's your name? Jim Jones, ain't it? What wouldn't she do, Jim? Fucking bitch, thieved. I'm sorry, what? The fucking bitch thieved. She stole from my dad, didn't she? What did she steal? Milk. Milk? Why didn't she have her own milk? We've got everything in the house. Dad said we need to ration it. So you took everyone's food and put it in your house? Yeah, fucking right. Why? Because the greedy fuckers will have the lot. Why did she steal milk? Why not something else? I can already guess why she took milk, but I want him to say it. Don't know. Why did she take the milk? I don't know. The words are drawn out and sullen. Yes, you do, Jim Jones. You do know why, so tell me why she took the milk. I could feel anger building in me. The arrogance and cocky attitude is winding me up. I can just imagine this little shit bullying his way through life, knowing his dad is the local big man. I don't fucking know, do I? Jim, I will ask you once more. Why did she take the milk? My voice is very low and sounds hoarse. I fucking said that I don't fucking know. He's defiant and staring at me hard. I slap him across the face with my left hand, hard and stinging. Then I swap the shotgun to my left hand and use my right to take a fistful of his hair and pull his head back. You listen to me. I don't fucking care who your dad is. Right now, there is me and you and that is it. He's squirming in my grip, staring rebelliously at me. I can see anger flashing in his eyes and I headbutt him square in the face, driving my forehead into his nose. It was an instinctive reaction, fury erupting in me from his arrogant and cocky manner. He drops down and puts his hands to his nose, blood pouring out between his fingers. I wrench his head up again. My own forehead really stings. I had no idea it hurt that much when you headbutt someone. I want to rub it, but don't want to do it in front of him. Why did she take the milk? Her kids. She took it for her kids. You forced a mother out into that lot because she took milk for her kids? You tell me now why. Why did you do that? Dad said to. Did you help? No, no, I swear I didn't. You are fucking lying to me. Your dad is the big man, so you're the big man too. You fucking helped, didn't you? No, no, I didn't. Lie again and see what happens. I had to. Dad told me to. What happened when she went back in? You killed her, didn't you? They did, not me. I swear it wasn't me that did it. Take this. I hand the shotgun to Dave and he steps forward and takes it. No emotion on his face. You fucking little shit. 
I punch the boy in the face, hard to the side of his cheek. I rain blows into him, fists pounding his head until he drops down to the ground, whimpering. Stepping back, I get control of my breathing and notice Dave is staring at me with what I can only think is a slightly puzzled expression. Get up! I bark at the lad. He staggers to his feet. His face is bloodied and bruised. I take the shotgun back from Dave. You are going to lead us out of here. Do you understand? Yeah. It's yes, not yeah. Okay. Yes. Now, walk. I push him forwards down the street and he staggers, then gains his composure and starts walking slowly. Take your clothes off, Dave says to the boy. What? Take your clothes off. I look at Dave, confused at the strange order. It's hard to run away when you're naked. Okay, you heard him strip off. No, please, please don't do that. Dave shoves the rifle into his face, pushing him hard against the wall. Now! Okay, okay! The boy starts stripping, taking his shirt off first, then his shoes and trousers. He's wearing filthy white boxer shorts, his skinny legs poking out of the bottom. Please, I won't run, I swear! Off! Now! He slowly bends down and pulls his boxer shorts off, covering his privates with his hands. Nice skid marks, Jim Jones. Did your dad tell you to do them too? Try wiping your ass next time, you filthy little shit. A few days ago, this act would have sickened me. If someone explained this situation to me in the staff canteen, I would deny that it was right and say no person should ever be treated like that, that we have law and order and everyone is entitled to respect and dignity. Not now. Hang on, Mr Howie. Dave runs back to the body lying on the pavement. I see him pick the gun up and pull the top bit back. Then a magazine pops out of the bottom. He checks inside, then takes the gun apart, flinging bits in different directions. It was old and badly maintained, he explains as though he needs to. We start walking down the road. Jim is walking with his hands over his bollocks, but Dave makes him put his hands back on his head. He looks pathetic. Just a skinny kid. Black tribal tattoos stand out on his pale skin. We reach the end of the road and Jim turns left. Where are we going, Jim? You said you wanted to get out, didn't you? Please, I'll tell you the way, just let me go home. You want to go home, do you, Jim? Yeah. What? I I mean, yes, yes please, Mr Howie. Fuck it, now he's calling me that too. Okay, take us to the barricade at this end. Really? Yes, but do as you're told or we'll kill you. Okay, Mr Howie. We keep walking on. The houses have suffered more here. Nearly every one of them has windows smashed and doors ripped off. Did you take all of the food from here too? Dad sent the boys out and told them to bring it all back so we could make sure everyone had enough. Regular saint, your dad. There are houses on both sides of the street. The barricade starts coming into view, blocking off the junction on the left. It's piled high here too. The same method with the vehicles parked end to end. They found more vans for this end though, and have stuffed the furniture between the gaps. The barricade forms from the end of the last house right across the junction to the end of the next house, sealing off Carter Street. There are only a handful of undead gathered at the barricade at this end, but as we get closer, we see lots of bodies on the ground, laying all around the end of the barricade and out into the road. Who killed them, Jim? We did. With what? I don't know. Anything we could find. Got any more guns in there? He pauses. No. A look passes between Dave and I. So what are the rules in your street? What rules? There must be rules. Can people leave if they want to? Yeah, of course they can. Dave rams the bolt on the rifle and pushes it into the back of Jim's head. He staggers forward. Don't lie, Jim. He will kill you. Trust me, he won't think twice about it. That's probably very true. From what I've seen so far, Dave wouldn't even blink. 
Okay, okay, they can't leave. But Dad said it was for their own benefit, as they would just get eaten by the zombies. Then the zombies would get inside. How would they get inside? I don't know. Dad said they would. So how does your dad stop people getting out? He's got the boys watching both ends. How do you get in from this end? Through the houses. And I suppose the boys have got the end houses to stay in. Yeah. Dave prods him again. Sorry, yes, Mr Howie. We stop about a hundred metres down from the end of the barricade. There's a brick wall to a front garden on the other side of the road. I look at Dave and motion towards it. He looks over and then nods. Jim is pushed across the road and we all go behind the wall, which is only waist height, but gives us some cover. Get over that wall and crouch down on your knees. Keep your hands on your head. I push at Jim. He does as he's told and clambers over and then gets down onto his knees. I lean one shotgun against the wall and press the other end to the back of his head. Dave has crouched down and is using the wall to lean on, with the rifle aimed over the road. John Jones! I shout out, but my voice cracks. Oh, Dave, you call. John Jones! His voice is startling, and I imagine it booming out across a parade square, terrifying new recruits. John Jones! Come out, or we'll kill the boy! The undead, gathered by the barricade, start turning and moving towards us. A side door to one of the houses on the left of the barricade opens up. There are faces looking out of windows at both ends. A burly man comes out of the door and walks towards us. He looks confident his thick arms swinging as he walks. The undead are coming across the road, getting closer to Jim. I can hear him whimper from here. The closest undead is an adult male. He looks like this breed, thick arms and torso, tattoos on his arms. Half his face is missing, bitten off, and the skin is shredded down to the bone, exposing teeth through holes in his cheek. Drool is hanging down from his mouth and also coming out of the hole. Fuck! Oh, fuck! Jim is trying to squirm backwards, but the shotgun is pressed to the back of his head. I watch the undead coming. John Jones stops in the middle of the road, arms hanging down at his sides. Two of the undead veer off and start towards him. He watches them without expression, then steps forward and slams his fist into the closest undead face, sending it reeling backwards. He grabs the next one by the throat and drags him onto the ground, then stamps down repeatedly on its face and neck. The undead he punched is laid out on the ground, trying to roll over. John Jones stops stamping and walks back towards us, one meaty arm raised and pointing at me. If you touch my boy... I raise the shotgun and fire at the undead, who is now just a few steps away from Jim. Jim drops down, screaming, and the undead is blown back, blood spraying out from where its head used to be. If Jones wants to show force, we can both play at that game. I drop the gun back down to Jim and push the barrel into the back of his head. Don't fucking move. Dad, do something. Shut up, Jimmy. Easy now, boys. What's the problem? You killed that woman. Yes, I did. Is that your problem? I killed her, and I will kill others if I have to. There's plenty of people in there. They need protection, and the food won't last forever. There's kids and families. Who's going to feed them and look out for them? You? She only took some milk. Is that what Jimmy told you? He's a fuckwit. He ain't all there. Kids these days, they're different in the head. He taps the side of his head as though to demonstrate the point. His tone is calm and very natural, easygoing, like he was talking to his best mate. The charm oozes off him. Now listen, gents, fair enough, you thought we'd done wrong. Fair play to you. I appreciate you keeping your principles. I admire that in a man, but that woman was a smackhead and she was thieving from us. We told her to stop, but she wouldn't listen. I got a whole street to take care of, and well, it might look hard to you boys, but there's got to be order. Now do me a favour, boys, and let the lad go. He sounds so reasonable, so calm and genuine. Between you and me, gents, 
I don't much care for the little shit, but his ma's in there, and you know what women are like. He can't do no wrong in her eyes. She'll give me hell if anything happens to him. I'll tell you what, John. I'll let him go, but only if you tell everyone in there that they are free to go if they want to. Sure, sure, I'll do that. They can go any time they want. But where to? Have you seen what's going on? They don't last five minutes out here. They ain't like us. They ain't survivors. Those things will tear them apart. You must have seen what they're like at night. They change. Yeah, we've seen. Well, there you go. I'm only protecting them till help arrives, just for now, until the law gets a grip of it. You boys can see that, can't you? Fuck me, he sounds so normal. I imagine some tyrant with a harem and armed bandits surrounding him. Fair enough, he was shouting when he came out, but I am holding a gun to his son's head. Mind you, the way he dealt with those two undead. So, let me take the boy in. I'll give him a good hiding for the trouble he's caused you gents, and you can be on your way. Or, I'll tell you what, why don't you join us? We've got food and plenty of booze. He takes a step closer and lowers his voice. And we got some nice-looking birds in there too, if you know what I mean, gents. A couple of young lads like you, well, they'll be all over you. No. You tell those people they can leave if they want to. Or what? Or we'll kill young Jimmy here. You'll kill him, will you? Go on, him. One less mouth to feed, if I'm honest. Jimmy, you tell your dad what we did to his brother and his mates. They shot him, Dad. They shot Uncle Jamie. John, Jimmy, Jamie. Talk about inbred families. John Jones' face flushes red. His fists start clenching and he breathes hard. Then he stares straight at me, and although I'm the one holding the gun, I can see the power in the man and why his son said he was the boss. You killed my brother, you fucking cunts. He takes a step forward and Dave shoots him in the leg. He drops down to the ground, writhing and clutching at his leg. Dad! Jimmy screams out. Jimmy, you run in there and you tell those people they can leave if they want to. You do that now or we'll finish your old man. You got it. You shot my dad! Jimmy scuttles over to his father, his bare ass poking up into the sky as he bends down to him. Jimmy, you listen to me. We'll kill him if you don't get in there now and tell them. Jimmy runs off, heading towards the door. Then another man comes out and grabs Jimmy, leading him back inside. An undead female is getting close to John. He rolls over, sees her coming, and starts trying to crawl away. I take aim and fire at her, the pellets tearing her to pieces. I break the shotgun and remove the empty cartridges then two more are slotted in. There's a lot of blood pouring out of John's leg. He's grabbing at the wound, trying to stem the blood flow. A window smashes off to the right and a shot rings out. We both drop down instinctively, pellets striking the wall and pavement in front of us. Another shotgun. Dave pops up and fires a shot at the window and I see faces drop down, out of view. Another shot from somewhere in the barricade. This one strikes the wall with a loud ricochet. Not a shotgun this time. Any ideas? I ask Dave. Shoot back. I stand up and fire both barrels into the barricade. Someone screams out in pain. Good shot, Mr Howie. Cheers, Dave. More luck than judgement. A loud crack and splinters of brick chip off near my head. Whoever is firing from the window is using the rifle now and getting better with their aiming. Another shot and more brick splinters. Bloody hell, he's getting closer. Dave lays down on the ground and starts wriggling along the base of the wall towards the entrance. I look up at the wall above me to see an undead leaning over. His mouth is inches away from the top of my head. I drop down onto my back and push the barrel of the shotgun into his face and fire. His head explodes and his body is flung up into the air and out of view. Fuck me! I want to lift up and see over the wall, but another shot ricocheting inches above me keeps me down. Dave has positioned himself against the wall and is slowly edging out to get a view of the window. The axe is still wedged behind my bag. The hard metal head is digging painfully into my back. 
Mr. Howie, can you draw him out, please? What? Can you draw him out, please? How? What do I do? Give him something to shoot at. What? I can't get a shot. I need to have something to look for. Oh, fucking hell. Okay, hang on. I take the other shotgun that Dave was using, the one with the barrels on top of each other, and start to raise it up to the wall until the barrel is poking out of the top. Two shots ring out, one of them from the window, which hits the barrel and sends it flying out of my hands. The other shot is a split second after the first and comes from Dave. Got him! Thank fuck for that. I reach over and pull the shotgun back towards me. The barrel is dented, rendering the thing useless. He broke your shotgun! You used my shotgun? Uh, yeah, he broke it. Right? He almost sounds annoyed as he shuffles back and takes it from me, inspecting the damaged barrels. He breaks the gun open and takes the cartridges out. He then disassembles the gun, breaking it into pieces. Sorry about your gun, Dave. It was a good gun. We still have two more. You can have one of these if you want. No, it's okay. Honestly, mate, I really don't mind. I shouldn't have used it. It's okay, Mr. Howie. I feel bad now. Shit, I'm sorry, mate. He looks genuinely upset. His face is impassive as ever, but just the slightest change in his manner portrays his feelings. Honestly, Dave, have one of these. I can't carry both of them anyway. Just take it for now until we get you another one. He slowly raises his head and looks at me, then at the shotgun lying by the wall. Really, mate, go on, take it. Are you sure, Mr. Howie? I pass the shotgun along so that the wooden end is just in front of him. Honestly, please have it. I want you to. He takes the gun and pulls it towards him. Thanks, Mr. Howie. I'll look after it. It's all yours, mate. He busies himself for the next couple of minutes, reloading the rifle first, and then he looks at me before starting on the shotgun. Where now, Mr. Howie? I don't know. We should get going but I feel terrible leaving those people in there. Mind you, I suppose they're getting some kind of help and protection, or at least they were until you shot him in the leg. Talking of which, I pop my head up and look over the wall, then straight back down again. Or rather, until you shot him in the leg and he got eaten by a zombie. Oh. We both raise up and look over the wall. John Jones is dead. He'd crawled most of the way back to the door, but the undead got him, Two of them are bent over him now, one gnawing on his already injured leg, the other on his face. He's almost at the door. Why didn't they come out and rescue him? They could have got him in while we were pinned down. I guess they didn't want to, Mr. Howie. Hmm, I guess you're right. The door opens and Jimmy gets launched out, still naked. He looks even more battered and bruised now. Blood is pouring from his face, and there are clear, distinct welt marks on his back. Behind Jimmy, another boy of roughly the same age also gets pushed out. Several men come out behind them, holding long sticks. One of them has a samurai sword. They start pushing the two boys away, beating them with sticks, hard strikes across the legs and back. The boys are screaming out, begging them to stop. Another man then steps out of the doorway holding a rifle in one hand. He looks at the boys being beaten and says something to the men. They stop and all step away from the boys. The man with the rifle looks over and starts walking towards us. Dave is over the wall instantly, rifle up and aimed. The man stops and raises his hands up to his sides, then looks at his rifle and seems to realise what he's doing. He turns back and hands the rifle to one of the other men, then starts walking towards us again, arms up and palms facing us, a clear gesture to show that he isn't threatening. He veers around John Jones and the undead, who have got to their feet now and have started towards him. Several of the other men are on them instantly, beating them with the sticks. The man with the sword chops down into an undead's neck, almost severing the head. The undead goes down and he strikes again, taking the head off, which rolls away on the pavement. It's all right, I'm not armed. The leader spits down onto John Jones and carries on walking towards us, stopping a few metres from Dave. I start to climb over the wall, but the axe handle hanging from my back gets caught and in trying to keep my balance, I fall backwards. I quickly get back up and walk round the wall, out through the entrance. I still have the shotgun 
but the barrel is lowered. Dave is standing with the rifle aimed at the man in front of him. Easy, Dave. Okay, Mr. Howie. Dave lowers the rifle but keeps his hands in the same position. I have no doubt that it would take him less than a second to shoot the man, who keeps glancing at the weapon, clearly thinking the same thing. So you are Mr. Howie. I'm John. Another John? Carter Street clearly has no imagination when it comes to names. Don't worry, I'm not related to that prick. He motions towards John Jones, then looks to the group of males gazing down at him. Derek, you better finish him off before he turns into one of them. The man with the sword nods and thrusts the blade into the throat of John Jones, then hacks away, ripping the flesh open. More of the men start beating the corpse. They are clearly angry and are whacking the shit out of him. As you can see, he wasn't well liked around here. What happened? He was always a nasty bastard, throwing his weight around. All the little shits looked up to him, though, and he had a following, so nobody could really do anything about it. What about the police? They were just as scared of him. His boys must still be in there. What about them? I think your man here did most of them round the other side. Jones went nuts and sent more after you, but only a couple of those came back. I've never seen him so angry. It was bloody great. We took care of the other couple when you lot were shooting each other. And them two there, of course. He nods towards Jimmy and the other boy. They've moved off down the road and have stopped a few houses down, Jimmy covering his privates with his hands. That Jimmy is an evil little shit. Untouchable because of his dad. Who's the other one? Don't tell me. James? John? Jamie? He smiles. Close. It's Jack. So... What will you do now? Another commotion as the door stops them from replying. A group of women have got hold of another woman with bleached blonde hair and orange-looking skin and are forcing her out of the door. She's fighting back at them, thrashing and kicking. They have a tight grip of her arms, but she's screaming abuse and pulling them about. A large, well-built woman breaks away and marches up to the men that are standing over John Jones's inert body. She walks up to one of the men and holds her hand out. Give me that stick, Terry. Love, no, I can't. He looks at the other men, clearly embarrassed. Terry, give me that bloody stick. The other men look away or at the ground. Terry hands the stick to her, and the woman snatches it and marches back to the thrashing woman, pulling the stick back and striking at the back of her legs. She goes down to the ground. The other women start kicking at her, blows hitting her stomach and back. The woman starts trying to fight her way back up, but is beaten back down and eventually curls up into a little ball. The women are screaming at her, spitting down. One of them grabs her hair and yanks her head back, then starts slapping her in the face. Jimmy and Jack start running up, but the men move closer, brandishing the sticks, and they stop still. Both of them are crying and putting their hands over their faces, taking steps forward then backing off again. That's the wife. She was the worst one. Trust me, she had this coming for a long time. I look at the man and he grimaces at the beating the woman is taking. The large lady drops the stick and grabs at the woman's feet, then starts pulling her shoes off. The other women grasp the idea and strip the woman naked. Her scrawny body is orange all over. John takes a step forward and shouts... That's enough, leave her now. The well-built woman spins round and screams back at John. No! You know what she put us through? Just because of her old man? She's a nasty bitch, so you stay out of this. John raises his hands and takes a step back. The large woman is furious. Spittle shoots from her mouth as she screams. Then she goes back and pulls the woman onto her feet by her hair. You can fucking beg. Get down and beg now. The woman drops to her knees and crawls around, sobbing and begging at the women's feet. Look at those saggy tits. No wonder he kept trying to shag us. They all start cackling, joining in with the humiliation. She's clutching at their feet, but they kick her away, laughing at her. The large woman grabs her hair again and drags her towards her two boys. Take your fucking mother and fuck off! 
The boys gather the woman up and start walking her away, hobbling and limping from the beating they've all had. John turns back to me as the women start heading back inside. Anyway, Jimmy said what you told him to say. We can leave here if we want to, so we'll be going. But where to? Where are you from? Borough Fair. It's near Brighton. Yeah, I know it. Is it the same as here? Everywhere is. I heard a radio broadcast saying that London had gone. Yeah, we heard about that. John Jones said someone told him. He doesn't mention the other parts of the radio message. What about the forts? I ask. What forts? The radio message said for survivors to head for the forts on the coast. That fucking shit. He told us the message said that the cities had gone and we had to wait for help. The fucking wanker. Is that where you were going? Eventually. First I've got to find my sister, then we'll be heading down. Where's she? London. You said that London was gone. My sister contacted my parents just before the phone stopped working and she said that she was locked in her flat. Well, I was going to ask you to stay with us. We could do with the extra protection and we got plenty of food. John saw to that. Thanks, mate, but I can't. Well, lads, if you change your mind, I guess we'll stick here for today and see about them forts tomorrow. Do they say which ones? No, but I guess any of them will do the job. I might see if we can send someone out to check first. Good idea. We all shake hands awkwardly. Right, well, I'll let you boys get on then. One more thing, mate, sorry, but how do we get out of here? To London? Well, that's easy enough. No, uh, we've got to run another errand first, something else we've got to take care of. We're heading towards Salisbury. He raises both his eyebrows and nods knowingly. Ah, Salisbury. Yeah, I understand, don't worry, I won't say anything. You need to head for Southampton. Is there another way without going through the towns? Yeah, head north on the London Road, then work your way over, but it'll take much longer. He gives directions to a junction, then explains that we have to decide north through the countryside or west to Southampton, which will be much quicker, but will keep us in the towns. Dave shoulders the rifle and takes the shotgun in his hands. My shotgun is loaded and ready, and I can feel the weight of the axe hanging from my back. We turn from the barricade and walk away. Chapter 19 It'll be dark soon, Miss Dowie. We're walking through quiet suburban streets. The signs of devastation are all around us. It looks like a war zone with bodies lying everywhere. I can hear flies and insects buzzing round them, slowly infesting the corpses with disease. A few more days and this will be a very dangerous place, not just with the undead, but also from the risk of decaying bodies festering in the baking summer sun. We've walked in silence for some time. The area is oppressing me. Portsmouth certainly put up a good fight, judging by the number of scattered bodies. If they'd been the victims of the undead, they would have turned by now. They must be either undead that have been put down or people that have been killed. But we don't get close enough to look. In some places, we have to step over the corpses as the ground is too thickly littered with them to go around. Coming here has sucked the spirit out of me. Up until now... I had a purpose, a plan, and somewhere to go. We still have that plan, but the last few hours have taken their toll. Seeing real people being killed, not undead, but real, normal people, has left me feeling empty. The world is crumbling at such an alarming rate. Everything we know has been taken away, and men still want to hurt each other. I'm not some naive dreamer. And I know what people are capable of, but seeing it happen and the speed at which it took place has left me appalled. There is a great feeling of shame inside me. Shame that we had to do what we did. Shame that I beat Jimmy and made him walk naked back to the barricade. I was no better than them. The clear lines of distinction between right and wrong have merged. John Jones was an evil psychopath. Of that there is no doubt. But in his mind... He was providing protection. Maybe he felt that he was doing the right thing. He wasn't a James Bond baddie, stroking a cat and laughing evilly. 
He was violent and nasty, but he had the sense to build that barricade and gather food, and he offered protection to people who couldn't defend themselves. I guess this was how the world was in times gone by, the strong protecting the weak, but at a cost. The end result was that we took John Jones out, but the people that replaced him could be worse, far worse. They will get a taste for power, and it will corrupt them. At the supermarket, it was common for shop workers to be promoted and enter into the management team. Some of them were hungry for it, and people could see that they were different. Most of the lads always said they wouldn't change. They would represent the floor workers and do what they could do to make it better for them, better hours, better pay, more breaks. For the first few days, they would keep their banter going and sit with the floor workers, but within a short time, they changed. The money was only slightly better, but just wearing a shirt and tie marked them out, and before long, the gap was there, evident and clear for all to see. I know, because I did it. I tried to keep in with the lads, stay as one of them, and I swore to myself I wouldn't change, but I did. I made myself get out on the floor with them. When I didn't have my own duties, I'd be working alongside them, but then familiarity breeds contempt and some would try to take advantage, which was uncomfortable at times. I remember the general manager taking me to one side just after I was promoted and telling me to keep a healthy distance from them. The buildings are pressing in on me. There is hardly any sound. The hot, fetid air is choking me, and I feel overwhelmed. Sun rays shimmer and dance just above the ground. I glance around, and it feels like the dark windows are watching us. This city was active, rough and violent, but it had life. A vibrant life, full of people of all colours and backgrounds. Now it's empty and sullen. It's only been a couple of days. What will it be like in a week? A month or a year. Stick to the plan, Howie. Get your sister and get to the forts. The forts are strong and safe and will be full of good people. Soldiers, policemen, doctors, nurses. There will be structure and order. I said it will be dark soon, Miss Dowie. He snaps me back to reality. I look at Dave, assessing his quiet demeanour and manner. No chit-chat or witty banter. He shows no signs that it affected him or had any impact. That was then. This is now. Despite everything that's happened, he still calls me Mr. Howie and shows deference towards me. I already owe my life to him several times over. I stop walking and stand, staring at him. Dave, why are you here with me? To get your sister, Mr. Howie. No, I mean, why did you come? Why go through all of this with me just because of my sister? You didn't have to come. You could walk away any time you want. I work for you, Mr Howie. No, Dave, you worked for Tesco and that's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. You can do whatever you want now. Okay. So why come with me? Why do all of this? My voice is rising. What about back there? You killed loads of people, Dave. You slit their throats and shot them. You shot them as they ran away. Doesn't that bother you? No, Mr Howie. Why? How can it not bother you? They would have killed us. Killed you. But it's only because you were with me that it happened in the first place. If you hadn't come with me, you wouldn't have had to kill those people. Okay. No, it's not okay, Dave. Exasperated, I'm ranting at him. None of this is okay, and it will never be okay, never again. We stripped a man naked and beat him. We killed people, Dave. We took their lives away. He stares back at me, his face still devoid of expression. Some men got like this in the service. Got what? Got like this after combat. It's normal. Normal? Fuck me, don't you have it? No. Why ever not? He shrugs and looks down at the ground. I'm different, Mr Howie. You're what? I'm different to you and other people. How? What do you mean? I know I am. I'm not like other people. I've always been like this. They always said I was. And thick, too. Who? In the service. They said you were thick in the army. Yes. Dave, 
You are not thick. I've never seen anyone do what you have done. You have such amazing skills. Really, Mr. Howie? Seriously, Dave, I don't know who trained you or what they trained you for, but it's incredible. Thanks, Mr. Howie. Okay, look, mate, I'm sorry for sounding off. I shouldn't have. It's just... It's fucking mental. He nods, then goes back to scanning around, eventually looking up at the sky. It'll be dark soon. We should find shelter. It's just gone 8pm. I think we should find a vehicle and get out of the city first. There's some side roads up there. They must lead to houses. Maybe we can find some car keys in one of them. A few minutes later and we're away from the big city buildings and into side streets again. It feels less oppressive here. These streets could be quiet at any time, so it doesn't feel so unnatural. Obviously the smashed in windows, burnt out cars and bodies lying everywhere are a little different than normal, but this is Portsmouth. We keep going, moving away from the epicentre of the mass civil unrest. There are still signs of devastation here, but less so. Another few streets over and we find some houses that look quite normal, with just the front doors open. There's quite a lot of undamaged cars here, Dave. I reckon most people try and park outside their own house, so what do you fancy? Sports car? Van? Something executive, perhaps? Or should we go for a four-wheel drive? I don't mind, Mr Howie. Oh, but sir must have a choice. Sir must choose from one of our exciting range. Silence. How about the colour, sir? What colour would you like your vehicle to be? Metallic paints and alloys may incur an additional fee. How about that one? Dave points to a very old, beaten-up Skoda Fabia. You really can't drive, can you? No. I move on quickly and see a Range Rover parked up ahead. An older version, but still a good, robust vehicle. Now that's more like it. What do you reckon? Dave looks back at the Skoda, then at the Range Rover and shrugs. I don't mind. You really have no taste, Dave. No taste at all. I try to keep the tone light to make up for my outburst a short while ago. There's something about Dave that makes me want to keep my head and wits about me. I feel a bit embarrassed about having a go at him, especially after what he said about being stupid. Let's try and hear. We move up to the front door of the house next to the parked Range Rover. The door is shut and locked. I knock several times. Hello, anyone there? We're not zombies, we promise. Silence from within. The door is UPVC double glazed, strong and flexible, and it will take some battering to get open. The house is terraced, and there is no obvious way of getting to the rear. I step back and aim a kick at the central panel. There is a loud thump, and the door rattles, but remains undamaged. I lean the shotgun against the house and start aiming hard kicks, one after the other. Within minutes, I'm breathing hard. Mr Howie? Hang on, mate. I keep kicking at the door. It starts to give, but refuses to budge further. The flexible material absorbs most of the energy from my kicks, rendering me pretty much useless. After several more kicks, I give up and bend over, panting. It's no good, mate. We'll have to use the axe or find another house. What about this? Dave is quietly holding a key in his hand. I straighten up and look at him. Where did you get that? Under that gnome. Oh, good, you could have told me, though. I tried to. Again, I swear there is a glimmer in his eye. Shall we, then? He steps up and unlocks the door, pushes it open and waits with the shotgun raised at waist height. He stands still and listens for several minutes. I know what's coming. Yep, here he goes, waving his hands around, twirling and pointing. Dave, if there are zombies, just say so. He turns round to me. I was saying to stay here, and I'll check downstairs. OK, mate, we really have to practice these hand signals, though. I'll wait here, then. He enters and starts checking each room, which takes seconds as the house is tiny. Just two rooms downstairs, a lounge and a kitchen, dining room at the back. He comes back to the front door. Would you like me to check upstairs, old chap? Uh, well, tell you what, why don't I stay at the door and you check it? Okay. 
He's up the stairs within seconds, and I'm not surprised after my bumbling performance at the farmhouse. I hear him banging about, and then he's back down. All clear. I wonder where they went to, then. Who? The people that live here. They're upstairs. You said that it was clear. It is. Then who's upstairs? The people that live here, I guess. Are they zombies? No. Then why haven't they said anything or come down? They can't. Why? They're dead. Shit. I run up the stairs into the bedroom and see an old couple in the bed. They're covered in the blankets. The woman is snuggled into the man, her head resting on his chest. They both have dried vomit stains around their mouths. There are two empty bottles of pills next to the bed. I stare at them for a few minutes. They look so peaceful and serene and it breaks my heart to see this. An old couple who made the choice to see the end in peace. Together in death, as in life. There is a photograph of young children clutched in the woman's hand. They must be her grandchildren. I choke up and feel tears stinging my eyes. Suddenly, feeling like an intruder, I leave the room and gently pull the door closed. There are coats hanging in the hallway. I check through the pockets and find a set of car keys, a Range Rover fob on them. We lock the door and put the key back under the gnome. Then I think better of it and put the key back into the door lock and leave it there. The house is secure and might just save someone else's life. I feel bad for the old couple, but the living will need it more than them now. Then an idea strikes me and I go back into the house and find some plain paper and a thick marker pen in a bureau in the lounge. I write the words safe house in big letters and stick the paper to the front door. The Range Rover is lovely to drive. The Tesco van was bigger, but this feels sturdier, more robust and capable. Plus, it's dark green, which might help when we're out of the city. We backtrack through the streets until we're back in town. It wastes a few minutes, but at least this way we can stick to the directions that John gave us. Shit! I shout in anger. The fucking tank is almost empty. Trust us to pick the only car with no petrol. I check my watch. It's almost 9pm now, mate. We've got less than an hour before it's dark. Keep looking for a fuel station. Then I smack myself in the forehead. Oh, fuck it. There's no power. Bloody pumps won't work without power. We can siphon it. Do you know how to do that? Yes. Dave, you're a bloody genius. I check the fuel gauge. It's on the right, so the filling cap will be on the right too. I pull the Range Rover up alongside a row of parked vehicles and cruise along until we see one with a cap on my side. We need a tube and a jerry can. Oh my fucking days, this just gets better and better. Where are we going to find a tube? I don't know. It'll take too long. We need to find another vehicle. I look at the sky. We need to be quick. Keep your eyes open. For a fuel station? No, Dave, for a car we can use. Okay. We drive away, looking left and right. All the vehicles in the area are either locked up tight or smashed to bits. Some have been burnt out. The panic is rising in me. I remember the howling from the undead as night fell, and then seeing them switch to fast-moving evil fuckers. I really don't want to be here when that happens. Although having said that, we haven't seen any undead for a while now. Stop! Go back, Mr Howie! What? What did you see? I select reverse and pull the car back adjacent to a junction on the left. What am I looking at? Down there. He points down the road, and I look at the row of vehicles until I see a large vehicle in the middle of the road. A recovery truck with an orange light bar on the top. The back of the truck is lowered down to the ground like a ramp. I turn in and drive towards it. Dave, you beauty, well done, mate. The recovery truck has a double cab and the words police recovery written on the side. I look to the row of vehicles and see a police car parked, the recovery truck positioned, ready to start winching it onto the back. The police car is an old Ford Focus and has seen better days. It must have broken down on Friday night and they'd called for it to be recovered, just as the world went nuts. Mr Howie? We're both out of the Range Rover. Dave is up front, looking in the cab, while I stare at the police car. I walk round to the front. Dave is now looking intently at an undead policeman a few feet away, wearing black trousers, black shirt and bright yellow body armour. 
His belt is full of hanging things. Leather pouches are all round his waist. The body armour has a walkie-talkie radio clipped on the front. His hands are ravaged down to the bone, and there is blood all over his face and across the body armour. He must have been on the ground, on his back and punching up at them. His knuckles have taken most of the damage, and I imagine him laid out with undead leaning down into him, punching up repeatedly until they bit into his fists. Poor bastard. He's shuffling over towards us. There's a can of mace or pepper spray hanging from a lanyard attached to his belt. Dave, you get what we need, and I'll take care of him. I wait for him to get a little closer, then move away a few steps, leading him on, teasing him with my tasty flesh. I keep him busy while Dave hunts around for whatever we need. Got it? He comes out of the cab of the truck, holding a length of pipe and a green plastic fuel can. He takes this round to the police car and opens the fuel cap, sticks the bendy pipe in and starts sucking on the end, then suddenly spits out a mouthful of liquid and shoves the end of the pipe into the jerry can on the floor. I keep dancing around the undead copper, leading him a few steps one way, then back in another direction. I shouldn't leave him here. He could get someone else if we leave him. But I don't want to risk making too much noise right now, so I run back to the car and draw the axe out from the back seat. Dave finishes filling the can and attaches a black spout to the opening and starts pouring fuel into the Range Rover. All done, Mr Howie. But you are, Dave. I'll just sort this one out. I step forward and chop down into his head, which bursts apart, bone and flesh spewing out as he falls to the floor. I wipe the axe on his trousers and walk back to the Range Rover. As I'm putting the axe on the back seat, I look at the green fuel can on the ground, then at the open fuel cap on the police car, and one word stops me in my tracks. Diesel. I run around to the back of the Range Rover, hoping and praying that it has a letter D somewhere in the model type. TDCI, TDC, fucking anything, please. Nothing on the back. I open the fuel cap, and my heart sinks. Petrol only. I shout out to Dave. We've put diesel into the car and it only takes petrol. Fucking hell. Quick, check the recovery truck. Are the keys in the ignition? Dave runs off and sticks his head into the driver's side. No. Bollocks. Fuck it. We'll have to run. Get the stuff. Quick. We'll have to go on foot. Why? You put diesel in the car and it only takes petrol. Oh, is that bad? Yes, mate. It won't run. It's fucked. I'm so sorry, Mr. Howie. He looks distraught, the same look of panic and confusion that he had in the supermarket when I told him he should go home. Don't worry, it's my fault, I should have checked. He stands there with wide eyes, looking utterly crestfallen. Dave, honestly, it's okay, it's really okay. Christ, look how many times I've fucked up. I put my bag on and drop the axe down before tightening the straps. Next, I break the shotgun and check that it's loaded and ready. Within seconds, Dave is kitted up the rifle on his back and the shotgun in his hands. We start off back the way we came, but within a few steps, we stop. There are several undead shuffling down the road towards us. They must have come out of the buildings on the side. I look over and see more of them slowly emerging. Fuck it. Back this way. Come on. We start running down the road and around the recovery truck and the now dead undead policeman. The light is fading fast and we need to find somewhere quickly, so we keep running. There are loads of bodies here, all piled up on the pavements, like someone has shoved them out of the road. Dave, we can't hide here. They will see where we've gone and surround us. Let's keep running till we lose them, then find someone to hole up. I'm gasping for breath and speaking is hard. Okay. The fit bastard is hardly out of breath yet. We run down a straight road towards a T-junction. The buildings on both sides prevent us from seeing any further than a few metres in either direction. The running causes the axe to slip down. It catches between my legs and trips me, sending me sprawling forward, and in reflex, I clench my grip on the shotgun and pull the trigger, shooting the side of a parked car. Loud, metallic ricochets echo into the gathering dusk as the pellets strike the panels. Mr Howie, are you all right? Dave runs back and helps me to my feet. My trousers are torn at the knees, which are both scuffed and bleeding. Sorry, mate, I shot that car. It makes up for you putting the wrong fuel in, though, I say with a sheepish grin. 
Keep your hand away from the trigger until you need it, Mr. Howie. Yeah, uh, good advice. Will do, mate. I wince as I get up. My knees both hurt and I've grazed my left hand. I take the axe in one hand and the shotgun in the other and we keep running, although a little bit slower now. We reach the end of the road and ahead of us there is one long grey building running in both directions. Off to the left, blocking the road entirely, is a massive crowd of undead. They are a couple of hundred metres up the road, but there are loads of them. They seem to all face towards the grey building, but the crowd is too dense for me to see what they're looking for. We look right. The road ends at a set of very high blue metal gates that are topped with rolls of razor wire and have sharp spikes at the pinnacle. We look around, desperately trying to see an avenue of escape. We'll have to go back and enter one of the houses. Some of the undead in the crowd must have heard the gunshot and have started in our direction already, with more peeling away towards us. The last tendrils of light fade and the shadows drop. Daylight has gone and night is upon us. The crowd stop as one and we look back up the road. There are undead behind us, now blocking our escape route. We go towards the blue gates and try pushing and pulling them, but they are locked fast. We might be able to climb up, but the razor wire at the top will cut us to pieces. Dave drops down onto one knee and shrugs his bag off, then opens the main compartment and takes out a plastic bag full of rifle ammunition and lays it on the ground. Next, he fills his pockets with shotgun shells, then puts the bag back on. This is it then. No way back, no way forward. I look up at the horde as they stand stock still, take my cartridge shell bag and fill it up, then tie it off on my belt the way Dave did, the hole ready for my hand to dip into. I look back up. The horde stops swaying and all raise their heads at the same time, looking towards the sky. They're in deep shadows now. The power has gone and the street lighting won't come on now. Or ever again, probably. The undead off to the right are doing the same. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Then they howl as one. They make one long, continuous, drawn-out, blood-chilling roar. The noise is immense and my throat goes dry. My hands are shaking and I'm glad that I'm not using that rifle. I'd probably miss all of them. I can feel my knees weakening. I heard this first last night, the zombie howl. But I only had one undead in front of me then. Now there are hundreds, all uttering the same deep guttural bellow. I look to Dave, but he doesn't flinch. He shows the same impassive look. His hands are steady and he has no sign of nerves. I take comfort from his courage. Dave, I just want to say, what the fuck is that? He looks at me in puzzlement, but I'm looking over his shoulder at the light on in the window behind him. There's a light on, in a building, with power. Then the light goes out and the window goes black like the rest. That light went on and off. There's someone in there. I look deeper into the shadows and see a door secreted in the corner. There's a concrete ramp leading up to it, and it's recessed in a small porch area. It was hidden from view before and now only seen because we're up against the gates. Fuck me, there's a door! I race over and start banging and shouting. The door is metal and I use the flat of my fists to rain blows down on it. The roaring stops as hundreds of undead cease howling at the same time. Then they begin to stare directly at us. The spasmodic head lolling is gone. They are the evil, fast undead once more. The closest undead is focused on Dave, the red eyes holding his gaze. Dave raises the rifle and gets his position ready. There's a long pause. Then the undead takes a staggering step forward and Dave shoots him in the face, blowing him backwards. Dave slams the bolt and fires again and again. I keep hammering at the door, yelling and kicking. The rifle cracks are so quick together with only the slightest of pauses while Dave reloads, then fires repeatedly. His speed and accuracy is awesome with every bullet striking ahead. They're moving now, gathering speed and coming straight at us. Dave pauses to lift the shotgun that was rested against his leg and blasts both barrels at the front of the crowd. From this distance, the pellets spread and there is a ripple effect as bodies are slammed backwards into the dense crowd. The effect is marginal. For every one he drops, more are coming, filling the gaps. 
I give up hammering at the door and start back towards him, ready to stand by his side. We'll go down together. A buzzing sound behind me, on and off, urgent and loud. I glance back and the buzzer keeps sounding. Then there is a clicking noise coming from the door. Dave, we're in. Come on. He glances back at me as I push the door open and bright light floods the area. Dave grabs the shotgun and runs over. My axe! It's still leaning against the gates. I run forward and grab it and they are almost on me now. I race back and lunge through the open door. Dave is already inside and slams the door shut as I clear the entrance. But the undead are already on the other side, trying to push in. Dave braces against the door. I join him and we fight to push the door closed. Finally getting it home with an audible click. Chapter 20 We're in a brightly lit, small room. There is a wooden bench on one side, fixed to the ground with big bolts. At one end of the room is a small cubicle with a heavy-looking door made of thick metal bars and a sheet of thick plastic fixed on the outside. There is another solid metal door at the end of the room, like the one we just came through. Frayed and peeling posters are on the walls, telling people to take their offences into consideration and that they are entitled to legal advice. One of the posters is massive and appears to have the same paragraph in many different languages. One last sign catches my eye. Officers should wait until the charge room is clear before taking the detained person through. A hatch opens in the door at the end and a small face peeks out. Oh, thank God. Thank you so much. Are you infected? Asks a female voice, high-pitched and squeaky but authoritative. What? Well, no, no, of course not. You're bleeding. I fell over and grazed my knees. I promise you we're not infected. We haven't been bitten or scratched, nothing. The hatch closes and we hear muffled voices. It reopens after a few seconds. We need to make sure you're not infected. Strip off. Strip off? Now hang on a minute, you can see we're okay. I'm not arguing with you. Strip off or get out. Dave and I look at each other. He shrugs and drops the bag from his shoulders, taking the Tesco fleece off. Now, hang on a minute. This is a police station, right? You're meant to protect us. Listen to me. You're bleeding and you're both armed. You won't get through this door and I can easily unlock the outer door and let them in. I drop my bag too and start pulling my top off. Dave is sitting on the bench, taking his boots off. I join him and we carry on in silence until we are both clad only in our boxer shorts. I glance at Dave. He is small built, but his body is hard with lean muscle. He hasn't got an ounce of fat on him and his thigh muscles look solid. I look down at my wobbly stomach and untoned body in embarrassment. Actually, it looks like my tummy has gone down a bit in the last couple of days, probably through lack of food. I'm not fat, just not lean or defined. We both stand in our boxer shorts and a face looks out and over our bodies. Then the hatch closes again and we hear muffled voices. Pants off now. She's back, speaking through the hatch again. What? We have to be sure you're not bitten, so pants off. Quietly seething, but with no choice, I take my boxer shorts off and step out of them, covering my privates with my hands. Dave stands with his arms at his sides and eyes fixed ahead. Drop your hands and turn around. I take my hands away and copy Dave by staring at a spot on the wall. We both shuffle round, keeping our gazes up. Once back facing her, I see her take a lingering look at Dave before barking her next order. Get dressed. The hatch is slammed shut and we look at each other and get dressed. They won't let us in with the weapons, Mr Howie. Shit, yeah, you're probably right. Let's see what happens. After we get dressed, the hatch reopens and the woman looks out, her face pinched and stern. Well done. Now, if you want to come in, you'll have to leave those weapons there. Dave was right. Do we get them back later? She pauses for a minute before answering. We'll see about that. Right, put the guns over by that far wall and stand in front of the door, and the bags too. A minute later, we are standing as directed, in front of the door with all of our kit stacked up in the corner. 
Dave keeps glancing back at the weapons. Right, hands on your heads and we'll open the door. I want you to step in, but keep your hands on your heads, right? Okay. We both put our hands up on the top of our heads. There's a buzzing sound and the door is pulled open. The room inside looks long and narrow, but as I step in, I realise that the wall to my right is in fact a very high desk with a larger space behind it. The walls are bare concrete, painted a very pale cream colour. The floor is also bare, apart from two painted feet at the bottom of a long ruler, measuring up to seven feet. There are monitors attached to the wall showing CCTV images, and I can see the horde of undead cramming up to the back door. Other images show corridors and exit doors within the building. One of the images is of a man lying down on a bench. The room he's in looks like a larger version of the room we were just in. A very young-looking policeman is facing us, aiming a bright yellow plastic thing. Don't move or you'll be tasered, the boy policeman barks at us. His face is set and I can tell he's trying to look tough, but his hands are shaking. OK, mate, no problem. The woman that spoke to us through the hatch has retreated behind the desk, just her head poking over the top. She looks to be in her late thirties. Her face is pinched and there are lines round her mouth where she keeps pursing her lips. She looks different and I realise that she isn't wearing any makeup, which is very odd in this day and age. Her face is quite harsh and she looks mean. Right, you are going to be searched while PC Jenkins covers you with a taser. Okay, miss. It's not miss, it's sergeant, she says, clearly annoyed. Okay, sorry, uh, sergeant. A silence descends while PC Jenkins and the sergeant stare at us, then at each other, then back to us. Dave and I look at each other and he shrugs. Um, who's searching us? PC Jenkins will be searching you. I can't, Sarge, I've got the taser. Right, where's Ted? He went to the toilet, Sarge. What about Stephen? Stephen? She yells out, and a very thin man with large, thick glasses appears at the doorway. He's dressed in a blue shirt, unlike PC Jenkins and the sergeant, who are both in black shirts. Yes, sergeant? Stephen asks. Search the prisoners, I mean, these men, please, while PC Jenkins covers you with the taser. Me, sergeant? I'm just a PCSO, I can't search people. He looks terrified. It's not a request, Stephen, and you can search persons under the supervision of a uniformed police officer. Why don't I take the taser and let Tom search them? He can't take the taser, he's not had the training. PC Jenkins looks alarmed. Oh, but I can search people though, can I? Well, yeah, it's completely different. It takes training and skill to use a taser, it's not a toy. Enough, thank you. Tom will cover with the taser and Stephen will search them. The sergeant barks out and they both fall quiet. Stephen moves forward and stops in front of me. I smile at him, feeling sorry for the position he's in. He's clearly scared. Stephen, you're in the way, PC Jenkins says. What? Stephen turns and sees the taser pointing at him, realising that he has blocked PC Jenkins' aim. Oh, sorry, move over, mate, Stephen asks Dave so he and I can step to the side. We start shuffling around, and Dave bumps into me, then tries to move, and again bumps into me. No, you need to move that way, Stephen says to Dave. Oh, this way? Dave moves the wrong way and steps in front of Stephen. Stephen, get out of the way, PC Jenkins says. I'm trying. Stephen is getting flustered at Dave as he keeps stepping the wrong way, and I start to get the impression that Dave is doing it on purpose. Sorry, sir, I'll move. Again, Dave gets it wrong and Stephen looks red in the face. The space is confined and PC Jenkins is berating Stephen for blocking his aim. Stephen, move out of the bloody way. Mate, you're in the way. Can you just move, please? Stephen snaps at Dave. I don't know why Stephen doesn't just search Dave first, as he's the closest now, but he's blustering about and not thinking straight. Stephen, will you get a grip and search these men? The sergeant yells at him. I'm sorry, I'll go this way then. Dave steps around Stephen so he is behind him and is standing between PC Jenkins and Stephen. For God's sake, this is just stupid, 
PC Jenkins rubs his head. Dave spins and snatches the taser with one hand and pushes PC Jenkins in the chest with the other. PC Jenkins gets knocked backwards, leaving the taser in Dave's hand. Dave steps back so he is at the end of the desk, then points the taser at the sergeant, then at Stephen, and finally back to PC Jenkins, who is leaning against the wall with a look of horror on his face. Now you just wait, the sergeant starts to yell at Dave in her squeaky voice. Sit down and don't move! The parade square voice from Dave. The sergeant quietens immediately and sinks back onto her high chair, and I imagine her feet dangling down, not touching the floor. I smile, just a small twitch of the lips as I stare at Dave in admiration. Bloody hell, mate, well done. Thanks, Mr Howie. Dave continues moving his aim from one to the other, showing them that he has a clear shot. Stephen is standing in front of me, frozen in terror. No one speaks for a few seconds. Hello? Hello, what's going on here, then? An older man walks in. Late fifties, thick set and bald with weathered features. He has a rolled up newspaper under his arm and is holding two disposable cups of hot liquid. He stops and looks at each of the people in the room. Oh dear, tut tut, well this seems to be a bit of a pickle, don't it? Excuse me mate, these cups are scalding hot. It's these cheap cardboard things, they burn your bloody fingers off. He steps round Dave and goes behind the desk, putting both the cups down and blowing on his fingers. Tea's there, Debbie. He doesn't even look at the sergeant, who's frozen. The new man is also wearing a black shirt, but he has the initials D.O. on the sleeves. Finally, he looks at Dave, then at me. So, what's it like out there? Still hot and horrible, is it? Uh, yeah, you could say that. Well, it had to happen, didn't it? So which one of you has the army voice? I heard it all the way down the block, and I thought, there's a voice from the services, if ever I heard one. Took me back a few years, I can tell you. It was him. I point at Dave, almost feeling like a schoolboy dropping my mate in it. It was you, was it? What were you in? I can't say. I bloody knew he would say that. Ah, I get it. The gentleman taps his nose and winks knowingly at Dave, then looks at the taser with distaste. You got that off young Jenkins, didn't you? I keep telling him not to keep waving it about. Did he listen, though? No, he didn't. They never do, these young uns. Mind you, we never needed him in my day. Oh, you're a policeman too? I ask him. No, no, not any more. I did my time and got out. He points to the initials on the sleeve of his shirt. Detention officer now. Five years, army, then 25 in the job, and I thought to myself, Ted, it's time to get out. But I keep coming back like an old fool. The old-timer is calm, keeping us chatting, but I can see that he is appraising Dave and I constantly. Years of hard situations and having to rely on his wits have left him sharp, and the experience is oozing off him. Ted? I'm Howie, and this is Dave. It's very nice to meet you. I step up to the desk and extend my hand. It's awkward, but Ted stands up and leans over. My hand is dwarfed as his giant fist closes around mine. You too, Howie. Nice to see someone still has manners. Ted turns to Dave and offers his hand. Dave, I think we can put it down now. Are you sure, Mr Howie? Dave says as he eyes PC Jenkins suspiciously. Yes, mate, I'm sure they won't do anything silly, will you? I look at PC Jenkins. No, he stammers, still scared. Dave lowers the taser and puts his hand out to Ted. They shake hands very briefly, and then Dave pulls back and wipes his hand on his trousers. I did wash them, you know. Dave looks at his hand, then back at Ted. Oh, sorry. Ah, I'm only joking. I didn't wash them, really. Dave goes back to wiping, and Ted laughs out loud, a nice, deep, hearty laugh. Ah, you special forces boys are all the same. Trained killers, I'll grant you, but funny buggers, though. PC Jenkins' mouth drops open at the mention of special forces. He stares at Dave with a keen interest. Bloody hell, are you SF? I knew you were SF by the way you took that taser off me. 
Wow, two SF in here, so you're on operations then? I knew they would send the SF in. Since Dave was remaining tight-lipped, I stepped in. We aren't special forces. We're just trying to get somewhere and got caught out, that's all. Where are you going? Salisbury. I knew it was a mistake the second it came out of my mouth. Salisbury Barracks? Wow, that's so cool. Is that where the HQ is? What? No, look, we aren't special forces. So why are you going to Salisbury? What can I say? I can't tell them we're going to steal a tank. We'll just sound even more suspicious. But thankfully, Ted steps in. That's enough, young Jenkins. You leave it alone with all the questions. Dave, I think we can give the officer his taser back. Dave looks at me, then at PC Jenkins. He checks again to make sure I'm not going to change my mind, then slowly hands it over, turning it so that the handle is facing PC Jenkins, who takes it and looks at Dave like a puppy. You can keep it if you want. PC Jenkins, that is the property of the constabulary and is not yours to give away. The sergeant is back with us, feeling confident again now that Ted is here and Dave has handed the weapon over. Sorry, Sarge. He looks crestfallen, chastised in front of his new hero. Can we get our weapons back now? Dave looks to Ted, not at the sergeant. I don't think that'll be a problem, will it, sergeant? Ted defers to the sergeant, but has made it clear what he thinks. She looks trapped and scared. Look, Sergeant, I promise you that we're not psychos or anything. We just got caught out. You've seen what's happening out there. The weapons can stay there if you're sure we're safe in here. Ted steps in again. Oh, this nick is safe. It's built to handle terror suspects, so the security is very enhanced. The only way into this part of the building is through the big gates or that outer door. The interior door is solid and can only be opened from this side. OK, then we'll leave them there for now. Tell you what, gents, why don't I take you to the canteen for a brew? That all right with you, Debbie? Well, it's time for the emergency strategy meeting anyway, and you two can come. She gets up and walks out from behind the desk. Stepping down from the raised area, she looks tiny, shorter than Dave by inches, but with the same wiry frame. She walks out of the room and down the corridor. Dave follows her with his eyes. I'll just show you the way after me. Ted goes out next, followed by Stephen and PC Jenkins. Finally, Dave and I leave the room and start down the corridor. I lean in to whisper to him. I don't like her much. The bossy attitude has annoyed me. He looks at me and pauses before answering quietly. I do. The corridor is long and we pass cell doors on both sides. Every few metres we have to turn sharp left or right. It's designed like that on purpose. Stops anyone being able to shoot all the way down the corridor. It disorientates anyone trying to escape. Ted gives us a commentary until we reach a solid metal door. Are we leaving this area? I thought you said it was specially fortified in here. It's okay. The whole building is safe. We keep checking it. The sergeant opens the door with a key and steps out. Stephen follows her, then PC Jenkins. Tom, where are you going? To the meeting, Sarge. Tom, you know you have to stay here. But Sarge... No buts. Stay here to let us back in and watch the prisoner. But that's not fair. Why can't he do it? PC Jenkins points to Stephen. Don't drag me into this. I'm not trying to look after a prisoner. PC Jenkins stares at Ted, who steps up and looks down his nose at him. Something on your mind, lad? No, I'll stay. He sighs and steps back in, holding the front door open for Dave and I to step through. Ted chuckles as the door closes. Keen as mustard and just about as bright, too. Did he say prisoner? Oh, yes, one of our locals. But with all this going on, why don't you just let him go? Ted chuckles again. Old Harry, he don't want to go anywhere, he's homeless. He spends more time in here than at the shelters. Every time it gets too cold or hot, he breaks something and waits to be arrested. Bless him. Bloody hell, does he know what's going on out there? What? Him? He's madder than a bucket of frogs. 
We tried telling him, but he just jibbers on. Nah, he's all right, wouldn't hurt a fly. So why is he in a cell then? He always has the same cell. It gets very strange if someone else is in there. The door is open and he can do what he wants. He can't get out or open a window, so he's quite safe. We go up a flight of stairs and Dave is keenly looking about, taking in all of the exits and windows, checking and rechecking constantly, and also glancing at the sergeant's small behind. I suppress a grin. Then we head along a carpeted corridor, passing several dark and empty offices on the way, full of blank monitor screens and office swivel chairs. Where'd you get the power from? The grid went out everywhere else. There's a generator in the basement. We have to be able to run the cell block in the event of a terrorist attack. We turned everything else off so we don't use too much juice. The sergeant ahead of us opens a door into a large conference room and switches the lights on. The room is flooded with bright fluorescent light. She then turns a few of them off, leaving just one strip on. I feel better now that we are with the organised authorities. They must have contingency plans and regular updates from the government, and they might be able to help find my sister. The sergeant is odd, but I guess she is just the desk sergeant, or whatever they call them. We enter the room and the sergeant indicates for us to be seated at the large oval desk. Then she goes to one end and sits down. There are weighty hardback files and manuals in front of her. Stephen, can you make everyone a drink, please? Yes, Sergeant. He goes to the end of the room and opens two cupboard doors. The bottom section has a kettle and plain white mugs. The top section has boxes of tea bags, a catering-sized pack of instant coffee, and boxes of sugar sachets and milk cartons. Within minutes, we both have a steaming mug of tea in front of us. Milk and sugar sachets are put down next to the mugs. We busy ourselves putting milk in while waiting for the rest to arrive. Chapter 21 A few minutes later, we hear voices, and I look to the door, waiting to see the senior officers and constables file in, but only two people enter. Two young ladies, one with a blue shirt on and one with a black. I realise now that the blue shirts are for the police community support officers and the black shirts for the proper officers. The two newcomers both sit down and I realise that Stephen has already made them drinks. There are no more drinks made. No one else is coming. Where's everyone else? Uh, thank you. We'll come to you in a minute. There is an order to these meetings, you know. The sergeant gives me a withering look. Ted just sits back and drinks his tea. Right, everyone's here. Then let us begin... The time is now 22.07 hours and I am opening the emergency strategy meeting. As the senior officer, I will chair the meeting and PC Trixie will take the minutes. I looked to the new female officer, blonde hair pulled back into a bun. She looks very young but very serious and is studiously holding a pen over some writing paper. PC Trixie, please record that we have two members of the armed forces with us. We're not armed forces, we're normal people. Yes. OK, I understand. PC Trixie will note that we have two members of the public as observers. Just note down separately that they are armed forces. Obviously, they can't officially be here in this meeting. She makes quote marks with her fingers as she says the word officially. For God's sake, we are not in the bloody army. Uh, thank you, Mr. What? It's Howie. I rub my temples. Thank you, Mr. Howie, but please stop interrupting the proceedings. Bloody hell, why is everyone calling me Mr. Howie? Now, for the record, also present is PCSO Stephen Taylor, PCSO Jane Downton, Detention Officer Ted Harding, PC Terry Trixie, and she looks at Dave. Dave, he offers. Dave what? Just Dave. Oh, of course. Terry, mark that down, will you? Obviously, they can't give their full names for security reasons. Now, on to proceedings. PC Trixie will just go over the minutes from the last meeting. PC Trixie flicks to some previous notes made on the same writing paper, then clears her throat. The last emergency strategy meeting was held today at 20 hours. She looks up and glances round at everyone. 
Uh, the same people were present at the previous meeting, with the exception of our two members of the public here. She does the quote thing with her fingers too. Now, at the last meeting it was required for a full inventory of supplies to be done, there was an issue with PC Jenkins walking into the female officer's shower room, and consideration to be given to the fuel supply for the generator. Thank you, PC Trixie. First, I would like to say that, in relation to Agenda Item 2, I have spoken with PC Jenkins, who assures me it was an accident and promises that it won't happen again. Fucking pervert. Yes, thank you, PCSO Downton. I have dealt with the matter and made it clear that disciplinary procedures will be instigated if it happens again. Now... In relation to item number one, who undertook the assessment of the supplies? You said that you would ask Tom, says PC Trixie. Ah, yes, of course I did. Well, he isn't here, so we can find out later. What about the fuel for the generator? Who did we task with that one? It was Tom again. Right, well, we can find that out later too. On to new items. We need to establish cleaning rotor. Any volunteers to draft one for approval? I can do that. Thank you, Stephen. Please draft the cleaning rotor and submit to me for approval. Once it has been approved, it will be posted in the canteen. Now we also need a sleeping rotor, a schedule so that we make sure we don't all sleep at the same time like last night. I can do that too. Thank you, Stephen. Please draft the schedule and submit it to me for approval. Once it has been approved, it will be posted in the canteen. Tom should go first. He slept all bloody night. Yes, thank you, PCSO Downton. Good point. Stephen, make sure that Tom goes down for the first night. Yes, Sergeant. Right, well, that just about covers everything. Questions from the floor? Stephen, do you have anything? Uh, just one thing, Sergeant. Tom keeps eating all of the lasagnas from the prisoner's food cupboard. He knows I can't eat the curry and I don't like the all-day breakfast. Thank you, Stephen. I will speak to Tom and request that he does not eat all of the lasagnas. PCSO Downton? Nothing from me. Just keep that pervert out of the showers. Yes, I've already covered that. Listen, Jane, if this is really bothering you, then you can take out a grievance against PC Jenkins. Just submit a report to me for approval and I will deal with it. OK. Thanks, Sarge. PC Trixie? Yes, I have a point to raise. At a previous meeting, a decision was taken to limit each person to a five-minute shower each. Now, while I accept that the water supply and power are important, I feel this is victimisation and prejudice. Female officers have longer hair, and it takes more time to wash and rinse out. Therefore, I request that the showering time for female officers be extended to ten minutes. Good point, PC Trixie. I'm in favour of this. It is true that female officers generally have longer hair and need more time for adequate cleaning. I pass the motion, and this will be effective immediately. Please note that down, PC Trixie. Noted, Sarge. I hope that isn't just female police officers. I have longer hair too, and I don't wish to be discriminated against just because I'm a community support officer. Very true, PCSO Downton, and a good point raised. Please amend the notes to show that all female employees are entitled to the extended shower period. Dio Harding? No, nothing to raise, thank you. Thank you, Dio Harding. And now the observers. Dave, do you have any points? When can we get our weapons back? Ah, right, a good point for discussion. I interrupt, exploding in fury. Now, just hang on a minute. What kind of shit is this? What the fuck are you lot going on about? Showers, cleaning rotor, what the... Stop right there, Mr Howie. I will not allow the use of profane or abusive language within this building. I don't give a fuck, I say as I slam my hand down hard on the table. They all jump, with the exception of Dave and Ted, who are both drinking their tea. Where are the senior officers? Where are the inspectors and superintendents? Where are the bloody policemen? Uh, excuse me, the term is police officer, actually, not policemen, PC Trixie says, glaring at me. I don't fucking care what the term is, and forgive me for not being politically fucking correct, miss, or whoever the hell you are, but what are you all going to do about that lot out there? 
There are thousands of zombies running around and eating people. Other people are killing each other too. Where are the police? Men. And the riot squad and the armed officers? Why aren't they here patrolling and putting that lot down? What about the government? What have they said to you? Have you had updates or been told anything? I glare at the sergeant. No, we haven't been told anything, she says softly. Nothing? No updates? No, nothing. What about your radios? You must be able to speak to each other. They went down with the phones. They work off mobile phone networks. Fuck me. What about the old radios that use radio frequencies? Oh, we sent those back when we got the new ones. Jesus Christ. I rub my temples again. You must have secure phone networks, some hotline to your headquarters. This isn't the movies, Mr Howie. We don't have anything like that. Email. You have power. What about emails? Oh, they won't work without phone lines. Policemen, then. Where are they all? And the senior officers? They've gone. Gone where? Be specific. It was a Friday night. We had a duty inspector, but he left when the trouble started. Some of the officers were out patrolling and just never came back. And those that did left to be with their families. What about your armed officers? We didn't have any on. We don't have enough as it is. The next division was covering our sector. So this is it. The glorious British police reduced to a couple of community support officers, two infant coppers and you. I don't mention Ted out of respect. He doesn't seem to notice, but carries on drinking the tea. That teacup must be bloody deep. Yes, this is it. So why are you here? Why didn't you leave to be with your families? We don't have anyone. Stephen and Jane are both single. Terry and Tom are new and got posted away from where they grew up. I'm not married and have no family. What about you, Ted? I soften my tone. Me? Oh no, I'm quite happy here. The wife took my kids to Australia years ago. This job's been my family ever since. I lean forward and rest my head in my hands, looking down at the desk. The realisation hits me that there is no hope for the authorities to get a grip on this. We lost the plot a few years ago, I'd say. I look at Ted and he looks deep in thought as he speaks. We used to be good at this sort of thing. Oh, we were shit at the community policing and yeah, we did isolate people, but we nicked more then than we do now and we were good at major incidents. We always trained and undertook exercises to prepare, but now it's all done from a desk. Us old dinosaurs tried telling them about the new radios, but they didn't listen. These young'uns get more training in diversity than they do in crime or major incidents now. I sit back, rubbing at my chin, which is fast becoming stubbly. I guess you couldn't have done much anyway. It spread so fast. I was just hoping that there would be some plan or something amazing, you know? Hold on, help is coming, that sort of thing. He shakes his head. Nope. So what will you do? Just wait here? Silence. No one wants to answer me. I look at Dave, but he is devoid of expression as usual. Armoury. You must have one. With weapons. Firearms. The sergeant shakes her head. No, we used to, but they centralised it and all the firearms officers have to go to the divisional HQ to arm up. I shake my head slowly. Dumbfounded at the turn of events and looking at the desperate people around me, clinging on to a world that has already disappeared, trying to use grievance procedures and making cleaning rotors. Maybe it's better than John Jones in his way, but it's sad. Very sad. So you have no weapons, no communication, no direction. What will you do? We do have weapons. PC Trixie butts in. Dave looks at her. Where? Where are they? In the evidence room. We seized a load of stuff a few days ago. What are they? I ask her. Well, there's quite a few air rifles. Dave sits back, suddenly uninterested. And some bullets. What kind? I don't know. They all look the same to me. Can we see? I ask the sergeant. 
Terry will show you. Dave, do you want to go? Okay, Mr. Howie. He gets up and follows PC Trixie out of the room. The sergeant then asks Stephen and Jane to leave us in private for a few minutes, and as soon as the door closes, she turns to me. I know things are bad, I'm not stupid, but they have nowhere to go. None of us do. But we're safe here. The building is strong and we can wait it out. We have plenty of food and water. Ted nods. It must seem strange to you, but they won't last five minutes out there. So we keep on. It gives them hope. Anyway, what have you seen out there? What do you know? I recount to them what we had seen so far. I leave out the bit about the undead stripper and Marcus. I guess they wouldn't be that interested. I also tell them about John Jones and the Carter Street Brigade, then about the radio message and the forts. They both lean forward and listen intently about the message, asking probing questions. I answer all of the questions as best I can, which doesn't take long, seeing as I don't know much. Finally, I tell them of my plan to head to London for my sister. At the end of my speech, they both sit back, thinking through what I've told them. Well, we can't do anything tonight, Debbie, but those forts sound good. They'll need a good sergeant. And an experienced officer, Ted, she replies. How will you get there? I ask them. There's an old riot van in the yard outside. We can put the grill down to cover the windscreen and plough through, Ted answers. Sounds good. Mind you, you are safe here. Yes, but we need to be with other people. We can get back in with the keys and the building is secure, the sergeant says. What about you? Ted asks. We'll have to push on. We'll join you later when I found my sister. I think we should bed down for tonight and get going in the morning when they are slow again. They look at each other and nod. Twenty minutes later, we are all seated in the canteen. PC Jenkins has joined us too. What about Harry? I ask. He's all right. He's fast asleep on his bed. Besides, he can't go anywhere, PC Jenkins replies, but looks to the sergeant for confirmation. He'll be fine for a few minutes, Tom. Thanks, Sarge. The atmosphere has changed. Ted and the sergeant told them about the forts and they seemed charged up and happier. Dave brought our weapons and bags from the cell block and is examining boxes of ammunition from the evidence room. Tom is next to Dave watching his every move and asking questions about the special forces. Dave just keeps replying that he can't say anything, which only seems to excite Tom more. Ted is sitting back, chatting to the sergeant. Stephen is cooking, well, I say cooking, he's microwaving food from the prisoner's cupboard, sealed packets of lasagna, curry and all-day breakfast. It feels nice to be amongst normal people again. It's only been two days but it feels like weeks. I sit back and watch them, smiling to myself, hopeful. I felt jaded and deeply forlorn after the barricade incident, but seeing these people chatting and joking, I don't know, it just feels nice. Later, Dave and I have prisoner mattresses and blankets brought to us, old, rough things, but thick and cosy. We make beds up on the canteen floor, P.C. Jenkins has given the good news about keeping watch for the first night, much to his disgust, and they all leave the room, he and Stephen bickering. The door closes behind them, and the room is in darkness. Only a sliver of moonlight comes in through the window. Tomorrow we go to Salisbury, find an armoured vehicle, and head for London. But the way things have been going, I can only imagine what lies in store for us. I look over at Dave, who is already asleep. We've been lucky so far, but how long will it last? Thank you for listening to The Undead, Day 1 to Day 3, by R. R. Haywood, read by Dan Morgan. Keep listening for the first chapter of the next book in the series, The Undead, Day 4 to Day 6, by R. R. Haywood, read by Dan Morgan. The Undead, Day 4 to Day 6, by R. R. Haywood, read by Dan Morgan. The Story So Far Having a rare Friday night off work, 
Howie was at home when the infection breached the borders of England and soon arrived in his hometown of Borough Fair. Luck saw him through the first night, when many others were taken down and infected, only to rise again as the undead. Howie survived these encounters, lurching from catastrophe to disaster, but escaping, learning, evolving and quickly developing a whole new set of skills. With Dave at his side, they braved the urban squalor of a ruined Portsmouth, and in so doing, Howie soon began to understand the desire to remain good in a world rapidly descending into chaos, where only the strongest survive. Day 4 Monday Morning Chapter 1 Mr Howie! A voice pulls me from my sleep, I can't seem to respond, though. Mr. Howie! There it is again, but I can't grasp a hold of it. The voice is near, yet far away. My sleep is heavy, and I feel like I'm wading through thick liquid, trying to grasp at a lifeline that is being inched away from my hands. Mr. Howie! Wake up! I'm being rocked now. I'm on a boat, and the waves are gently nudging the sides and making me roll. Oi! Wake up! I open my eyes to see Dave kneeling by my side, his hand on my shoulder. Ted is standing over me, smiling down. That did it. He's awake now. Here, get this down your neck. Ted hands me a steaming mug of hot liquid that smells like coffee. I sit up and take the mug. My head is foggy, and I drink the coffee in silence. It is strong and bitter and tastes like shit. My mouth feels furry and horrible and the coffee just adds to the awful mix, but the caffeine kicks in within a few minutes and I start to feel more awake. There's some cleaning kit for you both. It's the stuff the prisoners use. It's not great, but it'll do the job. I look over and see two sets of things on a table. I raise my mug in thanks to Ted. The shower room is just down the corridor. Help yourself and grab some scoff. I'll be back up in a bit. We're getting ready to go downstairs. He turns and leaves. Dave is sitting at one of the tables, drinking from a mug. It's daylight now. The bright sun is already streaming through the window. Looks like a nice day again, I say to Dave, who just nods quietly. So what have we got there? Dave rummages through the pile closest to us. Towels, disposable toothbrush, disposable safety razor, disposable cloth and soap. Is the soap disposable too? I don't know. I was joking. Oh. I stand up slowly, stretching my weary body. Despite the solid sleep, I feel exhausted. My mind is refreshed, but my body has taken more punishment in the last couple of days than in the last ten years. Oh my god, I ache from head to toe. Do you? No. I shake my head. Of course he doesn't. The man is a machine. Maybe he is a cyborg, a secret military robot like Robocop. Yeah, that explains it. Dave is a robot soldier cyborg. No, he's just fit, and I'm not. I take one of the disposable toothbrushes. It's sealed in a plastic bag, and there is a plunger behind the bristles that pushes the paste through. We could do with a few more of these. They look quite cool. I sit down at the table opposite Dave and lean back in my chair, the bottom of the mug resting on my chest. So, what's the plan? Salisbury, Dave says and looks up at me. You still up for it then? Yes. I know that I keep going on about it, mate, but this is my issue. I won't be offended if you want to go with them to the forts. No, I'll go with you. (laughs) You know I get my ass chewed up within the first five minutes of being on my own. Yes? You cheeky bastard. That's it, isn't it? You don't think I'm capable? Yes. His face is impassive, but that mischievous glint is back in his eye. Well, personally, I think I've done all the hard work so far, and it's damn time you started pulling your own weight. I'm not going to keep carrying you. Okay, Mr Howie. Good. I'm glad we got that straightened out. I'm going for a shower. He gets up to follow me, taking one of the bundles. Dave, I think I can shower safely on my own. I won't drown. Okay. He keeps following me and I stare at him as he passes me. 
There's more than one shower, Mr. Howie. How do you know? I checked. Of course he did. I bet he could describe the layout of the whole building by now and the contents of every room too. Ten minutes later, and I'm standing under a stream of hot water and it feels nice. The sharp spray is needling at my sore muscles. I remember that they said that shower time is restricted to five minutes for males, but seeing as they're all leaving today, I don't think it will be too much of an issue if I take just a few extra minutes. I've brought my disposable toothbrush in with me and I'm scrubbing at my teeth. The paste went within the first few minutes, but I keep brushing until my teeth feel squeaky clean. I use the bristles of the brush to scrub at my tongue and it comes away brown from the strong coffee I just drank. The soap is shit too and barely lathers up, but then it's meant for the prisoners. It's funny, but everyone thinks that prisoners get the best of everything. Good food, good bedding and all paid for by the taxpayer. But this stuff is really cheap and shitty. Last night was crazy. We got ourselves in a bad situation and it can't happen again. Getting trapped like that was unacceptable. It was pure luck that we were at the back of the police station. All it would have taken was for the people inside to have been away from the door or not looking at the camera, and we would have been just another couple of zombies. We have to plan ahead now, plan the route and get to somewhere safe well before the sun sets. They are too dangerous when it gets dark. From now on we will move and fight during the day and hide at night. That's it. No deviations. It's already Monday and my sister will be panicking and might be thinking that no one is coming for her. Two days of solid running and fighting seem like a week to me, so it'll be far worse for her, trapped alone in her apartment with no idea of what's going on. Dave has finished and is gone by the time I get out of the shower and dry myself off. I get dressed and go back to the canteen. Sergeant Hopewell, Ted and Dave are sat talking at one of the tables. Well, Sergeant Hopewell and Ted are talking. Dave is just listening. Morning, sunshine. Feeling better? Sergeant Hopewell says to me. Yeah, much better, thanks. Good. Right, let's go over the plan. According to your information, the authorities are urging people to head to the forts, the Victorian forts on the coast. Correct so far? Yes. Right. Well, we know there are lots of them, but we don't know which ones will be in use. We know that some of them have not been maintained, so they will be in a very bad state of repair, but are still possibly defensible, correct? Uh, yeah, I think so. Good. We also know that some of them have been maintained and kept in use by historical societies as tourist attractions. These may or may not be suitable, depending on the level of work done by the societies, correct? Well, yes, that makes sense, I guess. So... We don't know which ones are in use, or how many there are, or if they are full or will take us. But we have an old riot van outside, and as long as we can get out of here, we have a chance of finding them. Or at least trying to. Well, I suppose so. Good. Right. Now, are you sure that you and Dave don't want to come with us? I can't come, but Dave is more than welcome to join you. She looks at Dave, who just shakes his head. I thought so. Now, listen, we don't have much of a plan except to get out of here and go and look for them. But if all else fails, we will use this place as a fallback. If the forts are no good, then we will come back here and wait. Okay, so we will try for my sister and then the forts. If something goes wrong with that plan, we'll aim for here too. How do we get in if you're not here? Hmm. There's only one key to the main door and we'll be taking that with us. We can't really leave it anywhere because of the risk of someone else finding it. Also, we risk the place getting overrun by that lot. She jerks her head towards the window. Ted interrupts. The building has a flat roof. If you can get on the top, then you can drop down onto the internal prisoner courtyard mesh and get in one of these windows. We'll leave it unlocked. That's great. We'll just need a massive ladder then. Sorry, son, that's the best we can do. We can't risk leaving it unlocked and letting any Tom, Dick and Zombie in here, can we? No, I suppose not. Don't worry, son. Ted looks at the sergeant. Okay, next we need to get out of here. That lot are blocking the gates, so we need a diversion. Any suggestions? I ask. Well, yes, actually, the sergeant offers. The yard behind the gates keeps all of the marked vehicles. Most of them were out on patrol or were taken by the lads to get away. 
but we have the detective's carpool in a car park on the other side of the building. If someone can get to one of those cars, they could draw those things away from the gates. They both leaned forward, looking hopefully at Dave and I. This is Audible. The Undead. Day 4 to Day 6. By R. R. Haywood. Read by Dan Morgan. The Story So Far. Having a rare Friday night off work, Howie was at home when the infection breached the borders of England and soon arrived in his hometown of Borough Fair. Luck saw him through the first night, when many others were taken down and infected, only to rise again as the undead. Howie survived these encounters, lurching from catastrophe to disaster, but escaping, learning, evolving and quickly developing a whole new set of skills. With Dave at his side, they braved the urban squalor of a ruined Portsmouth, and in so doing, Howie soon began to understand the desire to remain good in a world rapidly descending into chaos, where only the strongest survive. Day 4. Monday Morning. Chapter 1. Mr Howie! A voice pulls me from my sleep. I can't seem to respond, though. Mr Howie! There it is again, but I can't grasp a hold of it. The voice is near, yet far away. My sleep is heavy and I feel like I'm wading through thick liquid, trying to grasp at a lifeline that is being inched away from my hands. Mr. Howie, wake up! I'm being rocked now. I'm on a boat, and the waves are gently nudging the sides and making me roll. Oi! Wake up! I open my eyes to see Dave kneeling by my side, his hand on my shoulder. Ted is standing over me, smiling down. That did it. He's awake now. Here, get this down your neck. Ted hands me a steaming mug of hot liquid that smells like coffee. I sit up and take the mug. My head is foggy and I drink the coffee in silence. It is strong and bitter and tastes like shit. My mouth feels furry and horrible and the coffee just adds to the awful mix. But the caffeine kicks in within a few minutes and I start to feel more awake. There's some cleaning kit for you both. It's the stuff the prisoners use. It's not great, but it'll do the job. I look over and see two sets of things on a table. I raise my mug in thanks to Ted. The shower room is just down the corridor. Help yourself and grab some scoff. I'll be back up in a bit. We're getting ready to go downstairs. He turns and leaves. Dave is sitting at one of the tables, drinking from a mug. It's daylight now. The bright sun is already streaming through the window. Looks like a nice day again, I say to Dave, who just nods quietly. So what have we got there? Dave rummages through the pile closest to us. Towels, disposable toothbrush, disposable safety razor, disposable cloth and soap. Is the soap disposable too? I don't know. I was joking. Oh. I stand up slowly, stretching my weary body. Despite the solid sleep, I feel exhausted. My mind is refreshed, but my body has taken more punishment in the last couple of days than in the last ten years. Oh my God, I ache from head to toe. Do you? No. I shake my head. Of course he doesn't. The man is a machine. Maybe he is a cyborg, a secret military robot like Robocop. Yeah, that explains it. Dave is a robot soldier cyborg. No, he's just fit, and I'm not. I take one of the disposable toothbrushes. It's sealed in a plastic bag, and there is a plunger behind the bristles that pushes the paste through. We could do with a few more of these. They look quite cool. I sit down at the table opposite Dave and lean back in my chair, the bottom of the mug resting on my chest. So, what's the plan? Salisbury, Dave says and looks up at me. You still up for it then? Yes. I know that I keep going on about it, mate, but this is my issue. I won't be offended if you want to go with them to the forts. No, I'll go with you. <laughs> you know I get my ass chewed up within the first five minutes of being on my own. Yes. You cheeky bastard. That's it, isn't it? You don't think I'm capable. 
Yes. His face is impassive, but that mischievous glint is back in his eye. Well, personally, I think I've done all the hard work so far, and it's damn time you started pulling your own weight. I'm not going to keep carrying you. OK, Mr Howie. Good. I'm glad we got that straightened out. I'm going for a shower. He gets up to follow me, taking one of the bundles. Dave, I think I can shower safely on my own. I won't drown. OK. He keeps following me and I stare at him as he passes me. There's more than one shower, Mr Howie. How do you know? I checked. Of course he did. I bet he could describe the layout of the whole building by now and the contents of every room too. Ten minutes later and I'm standing under a stream of hot water and it feels nice. The sharp spray is needling at my sore muscles. I remember that they said that shower time is restricted to five minutes for males, but seeing as they're all leaving today, I don't think it will be too much of an issue if I take just a few extra minutes. I've brought my disposable toothbrush in with me and I'm scrubbing at my teeth. The paste went within the first few minutes, but I keep brushing until my teeth feel squeaky clean. I use the bristles of the brush to scrub at my tongue and it comes away brown from the strong coffee I just drank. The soap is shit too and barely lathers up, but then it's meant for the prisoners. It's funny, but everyone thinks that prisoners get the best of everything. Good food, good bedding, and all paid for by the taxpayer. But this stuff is really cheap and shitty. Last night was crazy. We got ourselves in a bad situation, and it can't happen again. Getting trapped like that was unacceptable. It was pure luck that we were at the back of the police station. All it would have taken was for the people inside to have been away from the door or not looking at the camera, and we would have been just another couple of zombies. We have to plan ahead now, plan the route and get to somewhere safe well before the sun sets. They are too dangerous when it gets dark. From now on we will move and fight during the day and hide at night. That's it. No deviations. It's already Monday and my sister will be panicking and might be thinking that no one is coming for her. Two days of solid running and fighting seem like a week to me, so it'll be far worse for her, trapped alone in her apartment with no idea of what's going on. Dave has finished and is gone by the time I get out of the shower and dry myself off. I get dressed and go back to the canteen. Sergeant Hopewell, Ted and Dave are sat talking at one of the tables. Well, Sergeant Hopewell and Ted are talking. Dave is just listening. Morning, sunshine. Feeling better? Sergeant Hopewell says to me. Yeah, much better, thanks. Good. Right, let's go over the plan. According to your information, the authorities are urging people to head to the forts, the Victorian forts on the coast. Correct so far? Yes. Right. Well, we know there are lots of them, but we don't know which ones will be in use. We know that some of them have not been maintained, so they will be in a very bad state of repair, but are still possibly defensible, correct? Uh, yeah, I think so. Good. We also know that some of them have been maintained and kept in use by historical societies as tourist attractions. These may or may not be suitable, depending on the level of work done by the societies, correct? Well, yes, that makes sense, I guess. So, we don't know which ones are in use, or how many there are, or if they are full or will take us, but we have an old riot van outside, and as long as we can get out of here, we have a chance of finding them, or at least trying to. Well, I suppose so. Good. Right. Now, are you sure that you and Dave don't want to come with us? I can't come, but Dave is more than welcome to join you. She looks at Dave, who just shakes his head. I thought so. Now, listen, we don't have much of a plan except to get out of here and go and look for them. But if all else fails, we will use this place as a fallback. If the forts are no good, then we will come back here and wait. OK, so we will try for my sister and then the forts. If something goes wrong with that plan, we'll aim for here too. How do we get in if you're not here? Hmm. There's only one key to the main door and we'll be taking that with us. We can't really leave it anywhere because of the risk of someone else finding it. Also, we risk the place getting overrun by that lot. She jerks her head towards the window. Ted interrupts. The building has a flat roof. If you can get on the top, then you can drop down onto the internal prisoner courtyard mesh and get in one of these windows. We'll leave it unlocked. 
That's great. We'll just need a massive ladder then. Sorry, son, that's the best we can do. We can't risk leaving it unlocked and letting any Tom, Dick and Zombie in here, can we? No, I suppose not. Don't worry, son. Ted looks at the sergeant. Okay, next we need to get out of here. That lot are blocking the gates, so we need a diversion. Any suggestions? I ask. Well, yes, actually, the sergeant offers. The yard behind the gates keeps all of the marked vehicles. Most of them were out on patrol or were taken by the lads to get away. But we have the detective's carpool in a car park on the other side of the building. If someone can get to one of those cars, they could draw those things away from the gates. They both lean forward, looking hopefully at Dave and I. Chapter 2 The undead horde gather outside the metal gates, spilling out into the road and down the side of the police station. The bodies are pressed tightly together, pushing towards the last place their prey was seen. Hundreds of pairs of arms hang down limply as the undead twitch around and knock into each other in the confined space. Hundreds of zombie heads roll back and forth, left and right. The shuffling steps are slow and cumbersome, feet dragging along the ground. Some of them lurch and spasm as they move, with their drooling saliva flinging off to coat those around it. More have arrived during the night, drawn by the sounds and smells of their kin. The skin is starting to decay now. White people are becoming greyer, and those with darker skin are becoming lighter. The heat bearing down on the undead flesh has increased the rate of decay and their flesh is hanging off. Flies and insects are drawn to the rancid stench of rotting meat and have laid eggs in the open wounds. Before long, they will hatch and tiny white maggots will start to consume the flesh around them. Each life form has a desire to live and will strive for survival. The flies will lay the eggs, the maggots will consume the body, and the infection inside the undead bodies knows this. It knows that there is a limited lifespan on these feeble host bodies. The infection has already had to evolve and adapt, and it is rapidly learning new ways to harness the body and find more hosts. During the night, an undead fell to the floor. The body was too broken to keep upright, so the infection ceased the use of its legs. The body can still see, but it can't move and the infection knows this host body will crumble away before long. The prone body is facing a house's driveway. Within minutes, a small flap at the bottom of the front door opens, and a diminutive cat walks out, sniffs the air and starts cleaning itself, its lithe body almost bent double as it reaches around to lick its behind. The cat then walks down the garden path and stops when it sees the body. With effortless grace, the cat jumps up onto the garden wall and looks down at the body. The infection looks through the undead's eyes and watches the cat jump down from the wall and approach the body, making a soft noise as it gets closer. The cat has been without people for days now, and although it can find food and water, it misses the rubs and strokes that people give it. The cat can lean its body against objects, but it's not the same. So it approaches the prone body and uses the soft voice it learnt, knowing that most people will react to this pleasant noise and rub its neck. The infection watches as the cat stretches out and licks at the open wound on the nose of the host body. The infection drives the body forward and slams the head down onto the cat. The undead's teeth are open and ready, biting down into the feline's fur. The cat squeals loudly and lashes out, sharp claws raking the face. Then it squirms and drags itself out from under the head, bounding away a few steps, then falls over as it realises the wound is too great. The cat licks at the ragged wound on its back a few times, then lies still. Its breathing becomes laboured and the time between breaths gets longer, until the cat gives one last sigh and dies. The infection's primary function is to survive, and it must evolve more to do this. The infection learnt that the dead body can be brought back to a thing akin to life. The cells can be made to start the heart and move the blood around. It learnt how to make more blood quickly so that wounds and injuries don't drain the liquid away. Then it learnt to congeal faster and seal off the arteries to those wounds and divert the precious blood away from the leak. 
The infection can make the cells replenish some of the organs and parts of the body needed to make it keep working. It learned how to eat the fat away from the body so that it can have energy in order to survive and find more hosts. The infection knows that a single host body is not enough. They are weak and too easily overcome. So it has learnt to use the remaining senses to draw these bodies together. The infection forces the host to look for their kind. Now the infection has learnt that the smell being given off by the rotting flesh can be used as a scent marker and has diverted energy into the nasal passages which allow the hosts to smell each other. The infection has also quickly learnt that pushing the body too much will destroy it faster, so it draws them together to create a super-organism. The infection slows the rate of energy during the day and works to preserve the body and leave some small functions in order to move towards the prey, knowing it can use the weight of numbers to make up for the lack of pace. But at night, it can change the host. It can also urge the body on and make them faster. At night, it can drive that energy into the muscles and make them work so they can hunt. It learnt to make them hunt as a pack. It forces the host body to use its vocal cords and drive air out so that it generates a loud roar. The infection resonates through that noise and bids others towards its furore. The infection also learnt that the smell of fear is greater at night, and the sound it generates only makes the prey more fearful and therefore easier to find. But this isn't enough. The infection has consumed many of the bodies and they are already becoming harder to find. The prey has learnt to hide and stay away during the night. The infection needs to evolve faster and harness more energy, but these bodies are decaying far too quickly. The infection can slow this rate of decay down and keep these bodies working longer, but that means they will have to move slower, and if they move slower, the prey can get away. The infection courses through the bodies, examining the cells and the functions. The infection realises that all things in these host bodies are controlled by the brain. At first, the infection pushed signals out hard and fast and too close together, desperately whipping at the body to make it move faster, and not understanding the massive yet intensely subtle levels of cohesion this host body needs in order to work well. The result was that the body twitched and jerked, going into spasm if the signals were too strong, and was then too hard to control. The infection knows it must understand this brain and learn how to control the electrical impulses. The horde presses tighter and tighter now. Some of the bodies are crushed and fall to the ground, to be trodden under hundreds of undead feet. They twitch and they spasm, and the constant jerks thrust the undead first one way, then another, so that rippling waves are seen as they barge into each other. There is no cohesion, just a press of decaying bodies, all being pushed forward with the hunger for flesh. In the middle of the horde, one of them moves. It lifts its head and looks. The infection has learnt to keep the head still so it can see. The infection tests the electrical pulses, then it slows them down and stops them. The body goes still, and the head drops. The infection sends one concentrated signal, and the head lifts again. The infection controls those pulses, and the head slowly moves to look first left, and then right. Then the infection stops those impulses, and the head drops again. The infection sends out more defined signals in another direction, and gets a reaction. Then the infection puts those signals together. The undead lifts its head at the same time as it clenches both hands into fists, then it lets them go and makes them do it again. The infection has learnt to make only one undead in the middle of many hundreds look forward while making fists. But it's a start. In a quiet street in the south of England, there are flies buzzing around a dead cat that is lying next to a deceased man. The cat has been savaged deeply on its back, and the blood is still wet and glistening. The dead cat looks inert and lifeless, but deep inside the infection has penetrated each cell and has learnt the functions of this small body. The dead cat comes back to a half-life as the heart starts again and the eyes open, red and bloodshot. They are the eyes of the undead. Chapter 3 We're led down through the police station and emerge outside in the rear yard, our bags and weapons are with us, primed and ready. 
Dave told me that he cleaned and oiled them with a gun cleaning kit he took from the rifle bag. The old riot van has been brought forward and is facing the metal gates. On the other side, there are many hundreds of undead staring in. I was looking for a reaction when we first came out, but they just keep groaning and pressing forward. The ones at the very front are pinned against the gates, and their faces are warped as they are pushed onto the metal bars. The police personnel have already loaded the van with some equipment, riot shields and long batons. PC Tom Jenkins has found some old riot armour and a dark blue crash helmet with a plastic visor. He has leg and arm guards on in addition to the crash helmet. The plastic visor is pushed up away from his face, and I can see that he's sweating heavily. PC Terry Trixie and Jane Downton, the community support officer, keep looking over at him, tutting and shaking their heads. You look like a bloody idiot, Tom, says Terry with a sneer. It's the correct PPE in times of civil unrest. You should have some on too. What's PPE? I ask them. Personal protective equipment, Terry answers, then looks at the massed undead. Will those gates hold them? That must be a hell of a weight pushing in. They're built to withstand vehicle impact. They won't budge unless we want them to. Ted replies as he walks up to stand beside me, looking out at the gates. There's probably a few of our boys in there. I hope to God this lot don't recognise any of them. I look at the concerned expression on Ted's face. The old timer must have seen many things in his day. Even so, this must be shocking to him, but he doesn't show it. So... We get to one of the unmarked cars and lead them away from here, and that gives you a chance to get out. What are you going to do if we don't draw them all away? We can force our way through a few. Those vans are old, but they've been well maintained and still have plenty of power. It's a pity we can't thin them out a bit, though, I say to Dave as he joins us. Dave walks over to the police kit that is waiting to be placed in the van and picks up a long black baton. He walks over to the gates and runs the end of the baton along the bars. He examines the gates and the hinges, then takes the baton and starts pushing at the undead through the gaps. I walk over to join him, and despite what Ted said about the gates being very strong, I feel very nervous being this close. Bloody hell, they stink! I put my hand over my nose. The putrid stench of rotting meat is disgusting. I can't help but look at them. The injuries are festering in this heat, and their skin looks grey and ashen and is blackening around the bite marks. Hundreds of pairs of bloodshot eyes stare back at us, watching every move we make. Drool and saliva hang down from their slack mouths. The closest ones pull their lips back, readying for the bite. Dave is pushing at them with the baton, and I watch as he strains and pushes harder. Mate, they're jammed in there. He moves up and down, pressing against them at various stages. I look round and see an old-fashioned diesel fuel pump in one corner. We could burn a few of them. Dave looks at the fuel pump, then at the undead, and then back to the building. The station would probably go up too. Yeah, I guess. Any other ideas? He taps at the metal gates again and then looks over to Ted. Where's the generator? In that room. Why? Ted points to an open door across the yard. Have you got a maintenance room? In the same room, but again, why? Dave doesn't answer, but walks off, tapping the baton against the side of his leg. He disappears into the doorway, and Ted looks at me. Funny bugger, your mate, isn't he? Yeah, but bloody good to have around, though. You kind of get used to him. Tom bloody Jenkins, stop putting shit into that van. Just pile it up and let me do the loading. Ted bellows out at Tom, much to the amusement of Stephen, the other community support officer. And you can stop bloody smirking, Stephen. Now the pair of you get in there and start bringing the food out. Stephen looks down, embarrassed, and Tom starts a smirk. Then they both begin walking back into the building as Ted shouts after them. And make sure that old Harry gets a wash. He ain't coming in this van if he stinks like one of them. Ted jerks a thumb at the undead behind him. You taking Harry with you then? I asked Ted. Yeah, well, we can't just leave him, can we? Mind you, he probably wouldn't mind. He treats the place like his bloody home anyway. Old Harry is one of the local homeless people that breaks windows or causes minor damage to get arrested when the weather gets too hot or cold. 
Since the outbreak, he's been living in his favourite cell, with the door left open, so he can wander around freely. Where the hell has Dave gone? I wander over to the door and see Dave inside, pulling black electrical cable from a large reel. He takes the ends and splits the rubber covers back, exposing the bare wires. Do you need a hand, mate? Yes, please, Mr Howie. He hands me one of the reels. Can you feed the wire out until it reaches the gates? Okay, but why? He has taken the end to the generator and starts fiddling about with the electrical output socket. I shrug and do as I'm asked, walking backwards and feeding the wire from the reel as I go. When I reach the gates, I get the idea and start to chuckle. Do you want me to cut the wire? I shout back to Dave. No thanks, Mr Howie. He comes out and walks over with a small set of pliers and some electrical tape. He then cuts the wire and tapes some of the bare wires to the gate. Then he goes back and reels out another length of wire and repeats the action until there are two thick black leads taped to the gates, snaking on the ground back into the generator room. Ted comes out of the van and follows the wires with his eyes. Bloody hell, you're going to fry them. Don't touch the gates, Dave says as he goes back into the generator room. I move back, away from the gates, and see Ted doing the same. Tom and Stephen come out of the police station, followed by Terry and Jane. They all stare at the wires, then at Ted and I. What's that for? asks Terry, just as Dave shouts, Ready? Go for it, Ted shouts back. Dave does something inside the room, which causes the generator to increase in pitch from the gentle chugging it was doing before. I watch the gates in sickening anticipation. Now! Dave shouts. I see a spark come off the gates, and the first load of undead pressed against the bars begin convulsing violently. Stop! Ted shouts, and Dave pulls the power. The first row of undead all slide down to the floor and are instantly replaced by the next row. Well, it's good, but it'll take all bloody day, I say to Ted. Oh no, it won't. He pulls the end of a hose from the wall and walks over to the gates. Someone turn the water on, please. Tom and Stephen both dart for the tap and squabble about trying to get there first. Stop pissing about and turn that bloody tap on. Ted roars and shakes his head, then turns back to the undead, muttering under his breath. The tap comes on and a jet of water sprays out of the end. Turn it on full. The flow increases until the end of the hose is almost rigid from the force of water. Ted aims low and starts flooding the bottom of the gates. There is a slight decline going back into the road and the water pours across the ground, soaking the tarmac under the feet of the undead. Dave appears in the doorway and looks at what Ted is doing. He nods and waits for a few minutes until the ground is soaked and pools of water are forming. Tom and Stephen are now standing by Ted, watching him. Can I do it, please, Ted? Tom asks. Ted looks at Tom and hands the hose over, shaking his head again. He walks back towards me, rolling his eyes as Tom starts laughing with glee. Here, have a drink, you dirty shits, Tom shouts as he starts spraying the water directly at the rows of undead pushing against the gate. The sudden impact of the water elicits a huge groan, and a new surge develops as they strain forwards. Come on and get it! I can see their heads thrash about as the water powers into them. Let me try, Stephen says to Tom. No, Ted said that I could do it. No, he didn't. He didn't say that. Let me have a go. No! Ted? Stephen looks back at Ted with a forlorn expression. Ted shakes his head again like an exasperated grandparent with two squabbling grandchildren. You wouldn't think they were bloody police officers, would you? Just a pair of bloody kids, more like, he mutters to me. Stephen is trying to pull the hose from Tom, who is holding on to it for dear life. Please let me have a go, Tom. Piss off, Stephen. Go and support your bloody community or something. OK, fair enough. Stephen lets go and Tom snatches the hose away with a triumphant look on his face. It's OK, Tom. Just happy to watch, mate. Make sure you get all of them, though. I will. Tom, over there, you missed a load on that far side. That's it. You spray and I'll tell you where to aim. Now, this lot here, no, that lot. 
Stephen steps in to point at a group of undead to one side, and Tom aims off, just as Stephen snatches the hose and shoulder barges Tom to the side. Tom staggers off, leaving Stephen holding the hose and smirking. Both Ted and I burst out laughing, and then I look back at Dave, who is still in the doorway. I think he learnt that one from you, Dave, I say to him. He just shrugs and carries on watching. Stephen, give it back, that ain't fair. Tom whines and tries to pull the hose back, but Stephen directs the aim at Tom's feet, making him jump backwards. Don't get that bloody water in here, you idiot! Ted yells at him. Yeah, Stephen, don't get in here, what, you bloody stupid or something? Tom joins in, chiding Stephen. A massive puddle has formed on the ground beneath the gates, seeping backwards onto the floor beneath the massive crowd. That's enough, lads. Ted turns the water off and starts pulling the hose back in, taking away the temptation for them to start again. Try again, Dave, Ted calls over to him. Dave nods and goes back into the generator room. Ready, Dave calls out. Go for it, Ted shouts back. The generator increases in pitch again. Now, Dave shouts. The effect is amazing. The electrified fencing arcs down into the water and the horde of undead look like they are dancing on the spot. The undulations within the crowd are dynamic as they twitch and spasm uncontrollably. The ones at the very front are pinned against the gates and their skin is starting to smoke from being pressed against the metal railings. Keep going, Ted yells. I hear retching behind me and look around to see Terry bent over, vomiting on the ground. Jane is rubbing her back, but she too looks nauseous. Tom looks at Terry, and he immediately starts throwing up. Stephen, get them inside, please, Ted says. What? Why should I miss the fun? Stephen is smiling at the damage being caused to the still contorting undead. Jane helps Terry to go inside, and Tom staggers after them, still retching. Pussy, Stephen says as Tom passes. I piss off, Stephen, Tom retorts between spewing mouthfuls of vomit out. Several of the undead have smoke coming from their faces. One of them bursts into flames and then fire starts spreading along the entire front row. Shit, look at that. I've already set several undead on fire, so the flames don't bother me, but the fact that they are alight from being electrocuted is still quite shocking. There are gaps forming in the crowd where some of the undead are dropping down. The current being passed through them all prevents the rest from filling the spaces. More undead behind the first row are on fire now, and the smell of roasting meat is wafting over to us. It's making me start to feel bilious too. We'd better watch that the fire doesn't spread too much, Ted. Stop! Ted shouts out, and Dave powers off the generator. As soon as the current ends the entire front of the crowd fall down as one, leaving a wide open space. The ones on fire at the very front just slide down the gates, leaving burnt and smouldering flesh charred on the bars. The ground is packed with smoking bodies now, some of them still twitching and convulsing. I raise my eyebrows at Ted, who just looks at me. That worked well then, he says. Dave comes out and looks at the hundreds of bodies lying on the ground and the horde behind them still trying to push forward. The front rows are tripping over the bodies, and they are then trampled down. A natural barricade of zombie bodies forms and prevents the rear from getting any closer. Dave nods once and looks back at me. Ready, Mr Howie? Tom has walked us over to the door on the other side of the police station. We look out from a window and see a small parking area with several plain cars. Are they all Ford Focuses? Yeah, sorry, Mr. Howie. That's all the force will buy. Oh, well. Which one should we go for? Try that blue one there. It's the newest and probably the least damaged. We've already said goodbye to the rest of the officers. We now have to say our farewells to Ted, who I will greatly miss. Both Dave and I have our bags on. My axe is wedged between my bag and my back. Right, Ted. It was good to meet you, mate. I extend my hand, but Ted looks nervous and avoids eye contact. What's up, mate? I ask him. I want to come with you, he blurts out. I look at Dave, who gives a very subtle shake of his head. 
Ted, we'd love to have you with us. Dave and I were just saying earlier how great it would be if you could come along. Ted looks up, full of hope. But we can't, mate. We've seen how much you help the others and how much they rely on you, so it wouldn't be fair. It'd be selfish of us to take you away from them and give a pained expression. And I know that you're going to protect your team and make sure that they stay safe. He looks hurt at first, but then nods. He knows that his last chance to be an action hero has faded. So, listen Dave, we can't take Ted away from his team. They need him. We'll just have to struggle on, just the two of us. Damn shame though. I cut in fast before Dave can say anything. Ted, it's been a pleasure to meet you, mate. Good luck with getting to the fort safely. Yeah, of course. Thanks. And I'll hold that fort and wait for you both as well. Yes, mate. You'll be like a forward reconnaissance advanced recce pathfinder. I pat him on the shoulder, looking him dead in the eye as I speak. Then, shall we, Dave? Okay, Mr. Howie. Ted unlocks the door and Dave and I walk out. I hear the door being closed behind us. What's a forward reconnaissance advanced recce pathfinder, Mr. Howie? Well, if you need me to keep explaining these military terms to you, Dave, I'm going to get fed up pretty quickly. The area is clear of undead as they are all gathered round the corner by the metal gates. But seriously, don't they exist? I asked Dave. What? Forward reconnaissance advanced recce pathfinders. No? Well, okay, but at least I can drive. Yes, Mr Howie? Chapter 4 We get to the blue focus and load our kit onto the back seat. Dave goes to get into the front and then changes his mind and gets in the back. He takes both shotguns and the rifle and props them up so they are aiming to the roof. He then winds down both rear windows. I get into the front and look at all of the mess in the footwells, chocolate bar wrappers and empty cans of soda. Messy pigs. Oh shit, I didn't mean to say pigs. Sorry, I I didn't mean that. I scan around, afraid that one of them might have heard me, but we are safely alone. I start the car and back out of the parking space, then drive towards the corner of the building. As we nudge out into the road, we both look left, down at the horde. The mass electrocution has definitely thinned them out, but there's still a lot left. I turn right, then stop and position the rearview mirror so that I can see them. Have they spied us, Dave? No... The horde are all still facing towards the gates with their backs to us. I sound the horn and a feeble warbling noise sounds out. Anything? A couple have turned. That's it, though. Okay. Plan B, then. I get out of the car and take my shotgun from the back seat, then open my bag and get a few more cartridges ready. Dave watches me, then gets out and does the same. Dave, give him a nice big shout, mate. Oi! Dave bellows at them in his drill sergeant voice. We get more of a reaction now as they slowly turn and face our direction. I fire the shotgun from the hip, emptying both barrels into the crowd. Several go down from the spread of pellets. Dave fires next and more fall backwards into the undead behind them. We both reload and fire again. Most of the horde is facing us now, but there is still a big section at the front that is pushing towards the gates. The van won't be able to get through that many. Dave puts the shotgun back into the car and pulls out two long straight-bladed knives from his bag. He reverses the grip so that the blades are upright against his forearms. I feel a rush of excitement as adrenaline starts to surge through my system. I reload my shotgun and put it back into the car, then draw my axe. The heavy metal head feels good. We both look at each other and then turn and walk towards the horde. Strike and move, Mr. Howie. Yep, got it. Dave steps off to the right and I keep left. We walk for a few seconds until we are just over halfway to them, then we both stop. Dave, holding the knives down at his sides, faces forward. My axe is held in my right hand, also at my side. In the silence, we stand and wait. This horde almost finished us last night. We were inches away from death when we were saved. They were fast and switched on then, but now they are slow and we can get some payback. 
I think of my parents and start to feel the rage building up inside of me again. It's been suppressed for a little while, but I can release it now. I can unlock the cage that surrounds my heart. The closest undead have almost reached us now. Those that turned first had a few steps head start from the horde. They can taste the bite and I can see their lips being pulled back. I fix my eyes on the closest one, an adult male with half his face already torn away. He shuffles towards me, his head rolling, but his red eyes watch me. I step to the side and launch the axe at his head. The blade bites into the side of its skull, bursting the head open. It goes down, and I attack the next one with an overhead smash, cleaving the skull in two. I pick my targets and let the rage do the rest. Strike and move. I lash out, cracking undead skulls open, blood and brain matter spraying out. I move away and step backwards to keep my distance. The main horde is close now, but there is enough space between them for me to move in and destroy them one by one. The bloodlust is upon me, the glory of battle surging through my veins, and I unleash hell with my axe, smashing bones, cleaving skulls and bursting their skulls apart. Another one to my right. I backswing and it's knocked away. Then I slash to my left and drive the axe blade down into a shoulder bone. Then another one in front of me, and I uppercut the blunt back end of the axe head and obliterate its jaw, sending shards of bone into its brain. They keep coming and they keep dropping. Strike and move. We draw back slowly towards the car and they keep coming after us. They're too close now and we have no view beyond the first view to see if the riot van can get out. But I don't care. This is what I want. This destruction of the undead. I keep hacking away with the axe. The shuffling bodies are slow, and as long as I keep moving back, they can't bite me. I glance over and see Dave moving amongst them like a ballet dancer. His arms swirl as he spins and pulls the blades across undead necks. Arterial blood from the slit throat sprays high into the air as the bodies fall to the ground. He punches out with knives, puncturing lungs and breaking ribs with his blows, and more fall down. Watching him is like watching a master at work. The effortless movements are mesmerising, but I am brought back to reality by an undead face lunging at me. I slam my forehead into its nose and use the bottom of the axe handle to bat it away from me. The last time I headbutted someone it hurt like hell, but I don't feel any pain now, and go back to making war with my axe. I strike out at several more, watching them fall and die again. Then suddenly there is space around me and I look for the next victim. A single undead male is watching me. In my bloodlust and fury, I fail to take in that his head doesn't roll, and he's standing as a normal man would stand, head upright and eyes front. I charge at him, pulling the axe back. I'm staring at his neck, and I visualise the axe going through his spine and his head spinning away into the horde. I get to within striking range, and, roaring, swing the axe towards him. His hand raises and grabs the handle stopping the swing in mid-flight. We stare at each other, eyes locked. His hand is touching mine. I try to pull the axe away, but his grip is awesome and he doesn't move. He hasn't pulled his lips back or bared his teeth. He stares at me with those red eyes. There is intelligence within his face that terrifies me and roots me to the spot. I'm pulling back, trying to wrench the axe from him, and in my panic, I don't think to just let go of it. His one arm is strong enough to drag me towards his mouth, where his teeth are now bared. Just as reason gets hold of me, and I let go of the axe, a knife spins past my head and embeds into the side of his skull. Then Dave is there, pulling his head back and slicing his throat open. Dave drives him down onto the ground and pulls the other knife out. Go! Dave looks at me and we both start running back to the car. Within a few steps, we're there, and I get into the driver's seat and look in the rearview mirror. We have left a trail of bodies behind us, and I can see the horde are coming our way now. The gates are open, and the riot van has gone. At least they got away safely. Chapter 5 The infection watched from hundreds of pairs of eyes as the two uninfected made loud bangs and many host bodies fell. The infection saw the fresh bodies and wanted them, the undead turned and started towards them, being urged by the absolute craving to bite flesh. 
The infection has learnt that most will run away, driven by fear, but some don't run. They stand and fight, and a very few will come towards the host bodies. The infection knows that there are a few of them left now, and it is only a matter of time before they are all consumed. As the host bodies went towards the uninfected, one stood still and watched. He stood with his head upright, hands clenching at his sides. The horde shuffled past as he watched as his skin was struck down by the two uninfected. The smaller uninfected had no smell of fear about him, and his heart rate stayed normal. The larger one had a mixed smell, one of absolute rage mixed with adrenaline and fear, but they came on and they took down his kin. He watched as they got closer, fighting and dispatching bodies with ease. Then the larger one saw him and they watched each other. The infection saw the larger one charge forward and raise the implement he had used to kill so many host bodies. The infection sent signals as the larger one swung the implement and made the host body hold the axe. Then it sent more signals to that arm, making it stay still, locking the muscles out. The infection could feel the vibration through the host body as the uninfected pulled at the axe. The infection sent more signals to the host body and made the muscles contract, drawing the axe closer. The infection felt the muscles struggle to contract, so it sent more signals and more energy to that arm. The uninfected got closer, and it made the host body pull its lips back and have the teeth ready to pass the deadly saliva into this new host. Then something happened, and instantly it couldn't send the signals anymore. The brain had shut down and the infection wasn't able to control the heart or the muscles. The infection felt as if a wound was created in the host body and the precious lifeblood was released. Then the host body fell down and the infection lost control. As the host body shut down, the one remaining sense detected a change in the larger, uninfected one. It smelled fear. The undead cat slowly gets to its feet and walks a few paces, with shaky legs and the tail twitching furiously. Within a few minutes it gains more control, becoming steadier on its feet until it's moving almost normally. It stops and lies down and then rolls onto its back with its legs straight up in the air. Then it twitches several times and spins around back onto its feet. The front legs rise up and the cat tries walking, just on its back legs, but the balance goes and the cat falls over. The cat tries this several more times, then gives up and sticks to using forelegs. Then the cat runs and leaps into the air but lands awkwardly with legs splayed out. It tries again by running and then leaping, but it lands too heavily on its back legs and, again, ends up spread-eagled. It keeps trying, running down the quiet and deserted street, jumping into the air until it has mastered the landing. The cat reaches a wall and looks up. From down here the wall looks high, but it knows that it must be able to jump up. The cat takes some backward steps while staring fixedly at the top of the garden wall. The cat then lowers itself down to the ground and prepares for the jump. It leaps high and sails through the air, the powerful hind legs propelling it faster than it intended. The cat hits the wall and slides down into a heap at the bottom, the tail still twitching like crazy. It gets back up and again walks backwards while staring at the top of the wall, more height is needed, so the cat lowers down and again pushes off with its powerful back legs. The power was much better, but far too much, and the cat flies over the top of the wall with a strangled meow and crashes into a bush on the other side. It drags itself out of the bush, but a long thorny stick gets caught in the tail fur. The cat turns around to pull it off, but every time it turns, the stick pulls away. The cat speeds up, desperately trying to catch the stick that is stuck to its tail, spinning round and round in the front garden of the quiet and deserted street. The cat finally catches the stick, but the spinning has made it dizzy and it staggers about drunkenly until it falls onto one side. When the dizzy feeling passes, the cat gets up and looks back at the wall with narrowed, bloodshot eyes. It positions itself better this time, launches into the air and gets to the top of the wall but the power needed was slightly too much and its bottom drops down the other side. But it digs in the claws that it just found in its front legs and manages to pull back up. Once it is stable, the cat raises one front paw and watches as the claws slide out and then retract back in. Then it swaps legs and watches the claws of the other paw. Next, it lifts both front legs to watch them at the same time, but the sudden loss of stability from the front legs causes the cat to tumble and slide back down the wall into the front garden again. 
The cat leaps back up and learns to settle its weight down. The tail plays a part in the stability of this animal, and it fights to control the twitching. Within a short time, the cat detects movement from below. There are dead bodies littering the street, and one of them is nearby. The smell coming from it is very strong. The cat watches as there is movement from halfway down the dead body. The body is lying on its back, the face staring up at the sky. There is movement under the clothes, and the cat watches as a small black rat face pushes out from between the buttons of the shirt and pauses, sniffing about. The rat has been gorging on the insides of the body and has made a hole to get outside and rest in the warm sun. There has never been this much food before, and the rat is bloated and fat from the feasting. The rat pulls itself out from the gnawed skin and sits on the top of the cadaver. Its black body glistens in the sun from the juices inside the stomach cavity. The cat watches the rat while a primeval instinct from its once-living small cat brain screams out. The cat allows the instinct to take over and within seconds the cat has launched off the wall and pounced onto the fat rat. The claws come out mid-flight and are ready for the strike. At the point of impact, the cat sinks those sharp claws into the big fat rat belly and then bites into the neck. Hot rat blood spurts out over the cat's face. The cat wants to eat the rat but that isn't the purpose now. The primary purpose is to survive, and the cat complies, passing the deadly infection through the bloodstream and into the rat's body. Chapter 6 Did you see that zombie? Which one? The one that sat down reading the newspaper. Which bloody one do you think, Dave? Oh, that one. It caught the axe. It bloody caught the axe as I was trying to chop its head off. They can't do that. Why not? What do you mean, why not? They just can't. They're slow and stupid. They can't suddenly start using their hands and catching things. And Did you see its face? No. It was weird. It looked at me. It actually looked at me. They were all looking. No, I mean that it was holding its head up and really studying me. There was a sort of intelligence there or something. Oh. If they start doing things like that, then this mess just got a whole lot worse. What if they all start doing it? What? Catching axes? Not just that, using their hands and thinking. They'll be like us, I guess. Fuck me, this is bad. Very bad. Did you see any of the others do anything weird like that? Other than come back to life and try to eat the living? No, I didn't. I look over at Dave, surprised at the long answer and the sudden use of sarcasm. He glances back at me and suddenly looks a bit nervous. Sorry, Mr Howie. What for? Being flippant. You don't have to apologise, mate. You can say whatever you want. Okay. So anyway, maybe it was just a freak zombie, like a professor or something, or a soldier, like you, or a martial arts expert. Could be. But his strength, though. That was immense. If they all get like that one, then we're completely fucked. We drive in silence. Dave gets the wipes out and goes through his cleaning process. First the weapons, and then he cleans his knives and my axe. Next, he hands me some of the antibacterial cleansing wipes, and I disinfect my hands and clean my face. The used wipes go into an empty bag on the back seat. We use the road atlas that I took from my parents' house and work a route north out of the city. Before too long, we leave the urban area behind us. It feels nice to be out of the decaying city. The heat of the day is upon us now and we're both sweltering. These cheap police cars don't have air conditioning and the blower just sends more hot air into the car. Have you been to Salisbury before, mate? I asked Dave. Yes. What's it like? Big. No, I mean the army place. What's it like? Big. Ask a question, get an answer. OK, is the base easy to find? I don't know. I thought you'd been there. Well, just once. It was dark and I was in the back of a truck. Fair enough. So they train tanks there then. He looked at me, the same impassive expression, but with another glint in his eye. No, they don't train tanks. You know what I mean. Do they train people to drive tanks? Yes, and other things. The APS things. APCs, armoured personnel carriers. Yeah, them. Sorry. They have barracks and mock-up towns so that the infantry can train too. Oh, right. So there might be soldiers and army people there. Yes. Shit. 
I didn't think this through, as normal. I'm sure the army will let us just walk in and borrow one of their vehicles, or they might just shoot us instead. I was rushing and panicking after I realised my parents weren't coming back and not thinking straight. Right, so if we can't get one, we'll just have to head straight for London and hope for the best. Okay. I mean, it's only been a couple of days. It's Monday now, and it only started on Friday. My sister will be safe enough. I'm sure she will. She's just got to stay locked in and wait. Dave points ahead to a group of people that are standing in the driveway of a house. We're on a country road and passing a row of nice old cottages to the right. A small country church is on the left-hand side. The group of people are at the far end of the row of houses. As we get closer, I can see they're not people. Not anymore. Fuck it, more of them. We'll get past them. I start to increase the speed, but Dave waves his arm at me. Slow down, Mr Howie. He's leaning forward, staring intently at them. I slow the car down. What is it? Do you see something? I ask, concerned at his request. I want to see if they've changed. That makes sense. That last one catching my axe was very worrying. I slow down, but stick to the far side of the road. I drop the gears down and get prepared to pull away. There are only a handful of undead here. Most of them look very old and infirm. Grey hair and grey skin spattered with dried blood and festering injuries. One of them is a vicar or priest and is wearing a dark shirt with a white dog collar. We slow down to watch them. The heat is intense and the vehicle engine is the only noise I can hear. The undead are staring out into the road, already looking in our direction. I thought they would be watching the house and that maybe someone was inside. A signboard outside the house gives it away. The house is the vicarage. I guess it would be the focal point for a small hamlet like this. The undead start shuffling as soon as we pull up. We both watch their movements, but nothing appears to have changed. They look normal. Then I realise what I've just said. Well, they look like the other zombies we've met in the day. None of them look particularly clever. Dave opens the door and steps out. What are you doing? Hang on, Mr Howie. He walks round the car and towards the small group. His knives are in his hands. He looks round and then picks up a small stone from the side of the road then throws the stone at the vicar's head, striking him in the face. Dave turns, shrugs at me, and picks up one more stone and throws it at another of the undead. They don't react, but just keep shuffling forward as Dave throws stones and pebbles at their heads. I examine each of the undead in turn. The arms are hanging limp at their sides, and the heads are rolling about. The eyes are still red and bloodshot, and their movements are slow and awkward. Drool is hanging down from their mouths and the front of their clothing is soaked from the dripping saliva. Dave moves forward until he is only a couple of footsteps away from the vicar. The vicar, in turn, shows a bit more excitement and I see his lips pulling back. He lunges forward for the bite but Dave sidesteps him and the vicar stumbles and falls to the ground. Another one lunges at Dave but again he darts out of the way and I watch as the undead body staggers, loses its balance and goes down. Dave continues his routine and watches as they fall. For the first few minutes, I watch intently for any signs of different behaviour from them, but there's nothing new. I hear some of them groaning, and they almost sound disappointed when they miss him. I start smiling at the absurdity of it, Dave baiting them and waiting for them to surge at him, then jumping back and watching them stumble. It's like an old comedy programme, and I start chuckling. Then, Dave positions himself so he has two undead coming at him, one from the front and one from behind. He turns so he can see both of them and waits until the very last second as they both lunge at him with their upper bodies. Dave simply steps back and they headbutt each other with a loud thump, fall to the ground and get tangled in each other's arms and legs. I burst out laughing and watch as Dave moves around so that another one can come for him, but he smartly gets out of the way and the undead trips on the two bodies and lands on top of them. I'm almost pissing myself now. I can't stop laughing at Dave making the zombies fall into the pile. Within a couple of minutes, all but one are tangled in a heap on the floor, groaning with frustration as they each try to get up and keep knocking each other down. The remaining undead slowly inches towards Dave, who moves backwards and steps over a pair of legs sticking out of the heap. The undead trips and falls into them, and I'm out of the car applauding Dave and laughing loudly. Bloody well done, mate. That was brilliant. Dave turns and looks at me and does something I have very rarely seen him do. He smiles. We leave the tangled heap of undead and keep driving, heading west towards Salisbury. 
The atmosphere between us is nice and relaxed. Seeing Dave smile like that was heartwarming. He's so serious all of the time, and to see him play a joke and have fun reassures me that he is human, and not a cyborg soldier killing machine. It's still early, and the day is stretched out in front of us. The road we're on takes us into another village. A few houses either side pass us by, then more houses, until there are buildings on both sides. The road signs indicate a lower speed limit, and there are warning signs for children and the elderly, then another one saying, please drive carefully through our village. Rural England is sleepy and pretty, but full of more rules and laws than cities. Don't park here, use the litter bins, no skateboarding, no cycling, stick to the footpath only, no ball games. I love the countryside and these small places, but they're more like communist settlements than idyllic havens. There they are, Dave, all mustering in the village square. I wonder why they always stick together like that. Safety in numbers, Mr Howie. Yeah, probably. How many is that? I reckon about twenty or so? He scans the small crowd for a few seconds, his lips counting silently. Almost. There's twenty-two. I'll slow down so we can have another look at them. The square is set back from the road, and there is a small collection of shops bordering the village green. None of the undead are looking anywhere in particular. They're just shuffling around and dribbling on each other. As our car comes into view, they turn and start heading towards us. I know that it's only a small village, but there's more than 20 people living here. Where are they all? I asked Dave. Locked in their houses. Or dead, probably. Hmm. Maybe more people heard that broadcast and have headed down to the forts. If that broadcast was made from London to the whole south coast, even if only a few people heard it, they'll pass the message on, just like we have. And there could be loads of people heading down there. Could be. What about food and supplies? I know that we told some people to take what they can, but that won't last long. I stop the car so that we can watch the undead. Again, they look like the normal, slow daytime zombies. I can't see any with their heads up, can you? No. We both look around, checking the windows of houses, doorways, and any place an intelligent zombie could hide and watch. We were fighting for quite a while before that one reacted, and even then he just stood there watching. He didn't actually attack us. Maybe it takes a few minutes of action before they get bright. I wait until the nearest undead are almost at the back of the car. Then I drive forward a few metres. They follow behind the car, and I keep pulling forward every time they get within touching distance. Before long, they are strung out in a line, and I remember the armoured van that went past my house on Friday night and led them all away, saving my life in the process. I wonder what happened to that man, and hope that he made it somewhere safe. Shall I give him a little knock, and see if that does anything? Okay. I wait until they are within a few steps of the back of the car, then reverse into them with a loud bang. A few get knocked down, and I drive forward a few metres again, watching for any reaction. See anything? No, nothing different. Me neither. Let's give him a few more tries. The road ahead is clear, so I know that we can get away if one of them suddenly starts running at us. Still no reaction. It must have been a one-off then. Just a freak thing. Maybe. You don't sound convinced, Dave. Oh, and what's that down there? We both look down the road and see where the carriageway narrows into one lane and goes over what looks like a bridge. Is that a river? I don't know. I drive down, leaving the undead shambling behind us. There's a wide river ahead of us. The water looks cool and inviting in this oppressive heat. Just before the bridge, there is a landing platform for boats and ladders up the side of the bank on a raised section. That must be a movable bridge. Look, it's too low down to let anything other than a small boat get through. And that must be the winch that opens it. I point to a large metal wheel that looks well used. It has cogs that drive another set of wheels that in turn attach the cables that run under the ground. Right, it's my turn for some zombie fun. I look back at the undead, still coming down the road behind us. And it looks like there are more than the original 22. More are coming out of houses and joining the procession. I drive over the bridge and park the car on the other side. Dave, would you mind being the bait, please, mate? He looks at me for a second before shrugging his shoulders and getting out of the car. He then walks over to the edge, where the road meets the bridge, and stands facing the oncoming group. I move over to the large metal wheel and take hold of the metal handle that sticks up. I start pushing it, and I'm glad that the wheel moves with ease. 
The reaction is instant as the wheels turn the cogs, and I guess some clever machinery happens somewhere and the bridge starts moving. The two sections move away in opposite directions, creating a gap in the middle. Both sections stay horizontal, though, which surprises me as I thought they might lift up. I turn the wheel back the other way and the bridge closes again. Dave looks over at me and I give him a big grin and the thumbs up. He nods back. Say when, Dave. Okay. We wait for a few minutes as the undead do their slow shuffle down the road. The sun feels nice and it's lovely to sit here and rest in the silence for a few minutes. The first of the undead reach the end of the bridge and start to cross. Dave walks onto the bridge, heading straight for them, and then he stops a few steps back from the middle. The undead must be excited, having some fresh meat waiting for them. I wait until they're a few steps back from the middle, and just as Dave gives me a thumbs up, I start moving the wheel. The bridge starts to separate and the gap forms between the two sections. From my position, it looks quite funny as Dave and the undead swing away from each other. The undead keep moving forward and the first one falls off the edge and into the river with a splash. I burst out laughing and wind the wheel a bit more, making the gap bigger. More of them fall off and land in the water. The first one is floating past me, which I wasn't expecting. I thought the flow would be the other way if the winch was this side. There must be another winch the other side so the boats can travel up and down river. I watch the undead float past me. They don't panic or flap about, but just bob along silently. As the first one passes, I watch it sink down under the water. I turn the wheel more and stare as they keep walking off the end, like zombie lemmings. Then the wheel is turned too much, and they stop at the side of the bridge facing towards Dave. I wait for a few minutes until more of them have built up, and there's a nice little crowd formed, all staring hungrily at Dave. I slowly turn the wheel back the other way and watch the gap get smaller. They hold their position just staring across at Dave. Then, as the two ends are just about to touch, they all start shuffling as one, and I spin the wheel back, increasing the gap. The massed undead all fall off the end, splashing water up the sides of the bank. They land on each other and some sink down as the others are pulled along by the current. I laugh and wave at them as they go by, and they still turn their heads and try to move towards me as they pass. Within a few minutes, they're all gone, and our fun ends. I wheel the bridge back together, just in case someone needs a quick exit, and head back to the car. None of them were too bright, were they? No, Mr Howie. Right, time to stop pissing about and get to Salisbury. Chapter 7 The cat has learnt to keep to the top of the walls and posts and watch the dead bodies. Already it has caught several large black rats and passed the infection onto them, leaping down as they emerge from gorging on the dead and sinking its teeth into their slimy flesh, then letting go so the rat can run away, squealing to safety. The infection learnt to allow the instinct to take over the brain and functions so the cat moves with agility, but then the infection learnt to take that control back so the cat doesn't consume the new host. The infection has found this small brain much easier to control as the instincts are so intrinsically built in. The human hosts don't have those instincts to kill and move faster. They're stronger and more powerful and can last longer than most animals, but the infection understands their brains are far more complex to fathom. The cat readies itself, sinking lower and fixing its bloodshot eyes on the sleek black body below. As the rat emerges from a drain cover and sniffs the air, then starts forward, the smell of rotting flesh is too much to resist, and more rats slowly climb up from the sewer system and creep out into the road, drawn by the decaying bodies that are slowly cooking in the hot sun. The cat is held back and watches as more of the black, sleek, long-tailed creatures slink across the road. The first few rats ate from the bottom of the bodies and worked their way up through the meat and out into the top, where they would be caught by the cat. But the smell has seeped out as the bodies decompose and the juices spill onto the road. It is said that in modern cities, people are never more than a few metres away from a rat at any one time. Rats can survive in almost any environment, and now they can do more than just survive. They can feast. The cat watches as a few rats emerge, then more and more of them, until the road surface is blocked by writhing, shiny black bodies. The rats disregard the safety of going under the bodies, and instead they just eat the first thing they reach. Before long, a feeding frenzy begins, and the rats are squeaking as they fight to get at the bodies. 
The cat watches intensely as these small animals squabble fiercely to get at the meat. The dead bodies almost look alive from the movement beneath clothes and the twitching of limbs as hundreds of rodent teeth sink in and pull at the flesh. The infection sends signals to flood the cat's mouth with saliva, and within seconds, the cat is drooling, appearing hungry to get at the squirming rats below. The first rats to be bitten run away, heading back into the cool, dark sewers and pipes. The other rats all smelt the blood on the first rat's coat and started following the scent. Some followed the trail that led out into the road, where more bodies lay ready to be eaten. Some of the rats followed the injured one, detecting the weakness and being drawn by the smell of blood. The infection took control of that first rat quickly, and allowed the instinct to flee, to be all-consuming. While the infection stopped the blood flow from the wound, the rat made its way deeper into the underground network of tunnels, the superhighways of the rat world. The first rat got to a large sewer pipe and stopped. The lack of people flushing toilets and using showers has made the sewers drier than ever, and the scents within this enclosed network are drawing rats from all around. The advancing rats detect that there are many of them going for the kill, and they rush forward, desperate not to miss out on the chance of a meal. The first infected rat sits still, twitching its whiskers and waiting for the onslaught. The infection uses the acute hearing and smell of the rat and picks up that many more are coming, and it, too, floods the rat's mouth with saliva. As the first attacking rat comes on, the infected rat leaps and bites into it. Then it keeps leaping and jumping at the other bodies, biting and gnashing its big front teeth, working to draw blood from as many of them as possible. The action sparks a frenzy as the rats are whipped up by the smell of fresh blood and the infected rat is overwhelmed and consumed. The infection passes into many more of the rodents and they, in turn, are made to nip at each other and draw blood. The action and reaction causes the infection to spread faster than it has ever done as the rat population is quickly taken over. Back on the street and the cat is still drooling saliva over its front paws. The road is just a seething black cloth now, undulating and rippling as the rats feast and gorge. The cat knows that if it attacks now, it will be destroyed. There are too many of them, and despite its superior agility and strength, it doesn't stand a chance. The infection knows this, but is prepared for the sacrifice of this one tiny animal. The cat launches off the wall with a loud meow and lands in the middle of the writhing bodies. The instruction from the infection is clear and cannot be denied. The cat bites down, grabs a rat body and tosses its head, launching the rat through the air. The cat grabs another and keeps going, biting down and tossing them aside as the infection is passed on. The rats squeal. They know they are many and this cat can be taken down. They act as one and surge forward, biting into the cat's legs and body, taking the infection on voluntarily. The cat jumps and leaps and shakes them off, while still savagely biting into them and tossing the still wriggling bodies away. The injured rats land amongst their own kind, but the frenzy means that anything bleeding is fair game, and they're consumed by more rats. The infection has learnt to take instant control of this small body and sends the signal down from the tiny brain. Bite, but don't kill. Minutes later, the cat is bleeding heavily from bite wounds all over its body. The infection works to congeal the blood flow and the cat carries on biting into the black bodies. The rats, in turn, are now heavily infected. Some are still trying to get to the dead bodies to feast. Others are surging after the cat and many more of them are biting into each other. Rats that are heading towards the food are surprised at the sudden strange behaviour of being bitten by one of their own. And they try to move away quickly. But the infection takes hold and they too start lashing out. The cat still bites out as it's pulled down and hundreds of mouths begin feasting on its still living body. Even in the final throes of death, the cat bites out, then it sinks its head down and it rests in peace, as the infection is unable to push the animal any further. Chapter 8 Second Lieutenant Officer in Training of the Territorial Army, Charles Galloway Gibbs, stood and looked at the men that were facing him. Four months ago, he joined the British Army Intelligence Corps and is still at basic training at Sandhurst, the Army Officer Training Centre. A glittering and wealthy career in investment banking was in front of him, and he joined the Territorial Army for the uniform and prestige of being a British Army officer. 
He chose the Intelligence Corps, as he had been advised that it was the least likely unit to have to face combat, and he does not like the thought of combat. He's happy to wear the uniform and have lowly soldiers salute him, and all of the other perks, but not any combat. He was looking forward to the officer's day at the gentleman's club too, just so he could wear the uniform and act very secretive about his part-time role. He could just imagine the awestruck stares and jealous looks from the other men. He's an army intelligence. Can't say too much about it, of course. And the women, of course. Well, the uniform will only make it easier to get them into bed. But now, life has suddenly changed, and he is the only officer left in the British Army. Well, at Sandhurst, that is. He is also facing a scared troop of trainee soldiers in a classroom. So, let me get this right, chaps. You're all in basic training, is that right? Yes, sir. He gets a chorus of responses from the dozen nervous faces in front of him. So, none of you have done weapon training or combat training or anything like that, he asks. They shake heads and look down at the tables in front of them. They're in a building used for army education and administration. Second Lieutenant Galloway Gibbs stands in front of the classroom's rudimentary chalkboard and looks at the men in front of him. Most of them are young, no more than 18 or 19 years old, and they are all part of a new government scheme to take unemployed young people and provide them with skills, training and experience in the part-time Territorial Army in exchange for enhanced government benefits. Exactly what stage are you at, then? They all start talking at once, and Charles lifts his hand to silence them. Wait, just one, please. You. He points at a stern-faced man that is seated alone near the front. He has short brown hair and a surprisingly round head. You. Yes, you. Uh, Tell me what stage you're at, please. Sir, we're all new joiners, sir. We've been to assessment and selection and completed very basic training at our regional depots. We're here to undertake our first two weeks basic training camp, sir. Right, I see, and none of you have had weapons training. Charles directs the question to the same man. No, sir. Well, what have you learnt, then? Sir, basic skills like marching and admin work, rank structure and that kind of thing, but just at weekends, sir. I see. And how did you all end up in here? The spokesman glances around at the others, hoping that someone else can do the talking. But they are clearly happy for him to continue, and all look away as he turns to them. Sir, we only got here on Friday afternoon and we were just starting orientation and getting to know each other. They took us out into the training ground to show us around and... His voice trails off. And what? Speak up, man. Well, that's when it happened, sir. We were looking around the urban village training area. There was an exercise going on, and they wanted us to be the civilians for the exercise. Keep going, please, Charles says. Sir, it all went fucking mad. Blokes were running, shooting and biting each other. We thought it was part of the exercise at first. You know, like fake injuries and stuff. They were fucking real. Watch your language in front of an officer. Sir, sorry, sir. Well, what happened next? Sir, we waited for a bit, none of us knew what to do, but it got worse and someone shouted at us to leg it, so we did. Just the twelve of you? No, sir. There was about thirty of us, I think. The man looks around and some of the others nod in agreement. Thirty? Well, where are the rest, then? I don't think they made it, sir. It was fuck... Uh, It was dark and confusing and none of us knew where to go. I told you to stop swearing. Sir, sorry. So that was Friday night, and it's now Monday. So what the bloody hell have you been doing since then? The man looks around again, clearly uncomfortable with the harsh question being thrown at him by the officer with the posh voice. We ran, sir, but the training area is massive. We went into the plain where they do the tank training, and there's loads of hills and valleys, and we just hid. You hid? What, for two whole days? No, sir, we hid on Friday night and kept moving on Saturday, and then hid again in the night. We could hear them all around us, and we lost another few to those... those things. So you let your comrades fall behind you, did you? You left your brothers in arms to the enemy while you all ran away. Charles knows that he would have run too, but he feels braver now that there are more men around him, and he can see the fear and exhaustion in them. None of them answer. Some hang their heads in shame, 
One or two of them give slight sobbing noises. Are you bloody crying? Charles shouts at them. The British Army doesn't cry, now bloody grow up. He sneers at them and turns back to the unofficial spokesman. And how did you get back here then? We found the road that led back here and managed to get inside. His voice has now taken on a hard edge. Charles swallows nervously at the tone of the man and changes tack. Well, yes, I appreciate you all did your best. That's what the army is all about, isn't it? Doing your best, but please don't forget that you are speaking to an officer. Yes, sir. How did you get in here with all of that lot surrounding the outside? They're slow in the day. They don't move that quick and we just legged it through them. And in doing so, soldier, you have brought them all directly outside. Very smart, very smart indeed. Sir, how come you are hiding in here? Where's everyone else? One of the men from the back shouts. There's a hushed and silent few seconds while the gathered men realise what he has just said. Charles stares at the man with what he hopes is a hard look and walks slowly towards him. When he speaks, he hopes it is with a steely edge. Hiding, Private? Did you just say I was hiding? Uh, uh, well, officers don't hide, Private. I am an officer in the Army Intelligence Corps, and I was gathering intel. That's what we call it, you see, intel. I was doing so when you lot burst in here. Oh, and if you ever say I or another officer was hiding again, I'll have you up on a court-martial. Do you understand, Private? Yes, sir. What is your name? Tucker, sir. Roy Tucker. Do you understand me, Private Tucker? Yes, sir. Now, are any of you aware if there are any further survivors out there? They all shake their heads. Charles looks at the men. He hasn't told them that he too is still being taught. He hasn't done weapons or combat training yet either. Right, well, you lot look a mess and you also smell, so go and get cleaned up. He waves dismissively at them, buying time so he can think of what to do. He runs his hand down his slicked hair and tries to think what a proper officer would do, then realises that they are all still staring at him. I thought I just told you to go and get cleaned up. Sir, what's happening? What's going on? Is this everywhere? Is my family okay? Where are the rest of the army? Questions get thrown at him from the desperate men who have spent the last two days running away from zombie soldiers. How the hell would I know? He answers back. The man at the front stares at him. You say that you're army intelligence, sir, and that you had to report back. Well, that is right. Charles realises they want answers, and if he is going to lead these men and survive this disaster, he must tell them something. I'm sure you are all very worried, but the army will get a grip on this, and we'll all be here very soon. I'm sure. In the meantime, we must survive. So, you've not heard anything then, sir? Charles looks irritated by the man in the front. Not at this time, Private, but would you like me to report back to you when I do? His icy tone silences the man, who looks away. Now, I don't know what's going on out there. I can't reach anyone or make contact with anyone at this time. The phones are down and the radios too. That includes landlines and mobile phones. We have no choice but to sit it out and wait for help. Help, sir? Why don't we get the guns and fight our way out? Guns, Private? Where are they kept now? They're not in here. In the armoury, sir. Charles panics, desperately thinking of a way not to look inept in front of these common men. I am not stationed here and I do not know the layout. I too arrived on Friday for an exercise, so I do not know where the armory is, he says, stiffly, expecting them to tell him, but they all remain silent. Charles stares at them. So, where is it? he asks. They shrug their shoulders and shake their heads, looking at each other. So, none of us know where it is. Unless any of you want to go floundering around outside with them, then I suggest we sit tight here. Charles recovers the patronising tone. We could try, sir. They're slow now and we might be able to find it. The same man from the front just won't leave it. He looks tough, though, and Charles falls back on his superior breeding and culture. And what will you do when you get there, Private? Do you think that the army just leaves its guns in an unlocked room where just about anyone can get at them? No, 
They'll be locked and secure, so unless you have the key or the combination or a bloody big battering ram, then we will sit here and wait. But sir, Private, I have had enough of your questions. This is bordering on insubordination. What is your name and rank, Private? The man stares back before answering. Private, sir, don't be bloody cheeky with me, soldier. You're on a charge the minute we get out of here. Now, give me your name. Simon Blowers, sir. Right, Blowers, I don't want to hear another word out of you. I will let this pass for now as you are new recruits, but if it happens again, you will be on a charge, understood? Yes, sir. Right, go and get cleaned up. You're all a disgrace to the army in that state. And where are your uniforms? We were being civilians in the exercise, sir, so we had to wear our normal clothes. And your uniforms are where, exactly? In the barracks, sir. Right. Well, you'll just have to do the best you can until we get rescued. I mean, until we get reinforcements. Charles walks out of the room and up the stairs of the small admin building. He goes into an office and slumps down at a desk, rubbing his temples and thinking furiously. Maybe I should have just told them the truth. Told them I'm new too, but no, that would be embarrassing and then someone else will try and take charge. Like that bloody blowers chap. I'm not taking bloody orders from a common soldier. I'll just wait until help arrives with more officers. Then I'll be amongst my own kind and someone else can sort this mess out. Charles thinks about the event that's happening. He was in the officer's mess when it all started. An alarm sounded and everyone went running off, leaving him alone. He ran too, just so it looked good, but he didn't know where he was going. So he darted in this block and hid in one of the dark offices. It could have been a terrorist attack or something worse, and he didn't want to get involved in anything dangerous, so he sat tight and waited. When he heard voices, he started to sneak out back to his quarters when he saw the first undead soldiers. He didn't know that they were undead at the time, they just looked like men with awful injuries. He watched from the shadows of the admin building as they ran at the other soldiers and bit into their faces and necks, killing them. Charles had never seen anything so violent. His private school and expensive university kept him sheltered from such things. As more men ran into the fray, Charles crept backwards, deeper into the shadows, until he turned and ran inside, cowering under the desk, wishing he was anywhere else but there. During the night, he heard gunshots and screams and men running around. It sounded like a war was going on, and he felt stupid for joining the army and stupid for trying to be like his father, who had also been an officer in the Territorial Army. At times he would creep out and look through the windows at the undead soldiers in their blood-soaked camouflage clothing. After seeing them close to the building, he went back under the desk and hid. By Saturday, he had tried every phone in the building, but they were all down. He discovered an old transistor radio and tuned quickly through the frequencies, but got nothing. Charles would periodically look out, keeping low and taking quick furtive glances, but the scene didn't get any better. In fact, it got worse, as the weekend went by and more undead gathered and staggered about, close to the buildings. He found some food in a small kitchen area and ate through a packet of biscuits and then found some chocolate bars and crisps. He thought about saving them for later in case he was still trapped, but he ate the lot instead and then felt bad for not keeping them. At least he had coffee, until the power went off. Then he was alone and in the dark just listening to the terrifying roars outside as night fell, and then he heard the bangs and groans. He retreated back under the desk and hugged his knees, crying and sobbing in fear. Then this morning, the raw recruits burst in. He thought it was the cavalry coming to his rescue, and he had a story prepared. He had tried to fight, but had been knocked out and had only just come round. But they turned out to be brand new soldiers too. But still... At least he has some men to protect him and keep him safe. Cannon fodder. That's what Daddy always called them. The trainee recruits sit still and silent for a few minutes after the officer leaves, stunned at the cold arrogance and patronising sneer of the man. They joined the army for many different reasons, but being attacked by zombies wasn't one of them. Since the outbreak began, they've had time to discuss the event and come up with reasons and theories but none of them knew the extent of the virus until they got back to the main compound and saw the massive horde. There were zombie soldiers in a collection of desert and jungle camouflage uniforms covered in blood from severe injuries. 
During Saturday and Sunday, they kept their distance from the undead, running and hiding amongst the hills of the tank training ground. The land is military property and is heavily protected from the public, so none of them knew the direction they should go in or the way back to the barracks. It was by luck that they found the road and followed it to the buildings. Chapter 9 Thirty of them started the orientation on Friday evening. Thirty new recruits from different regiments and units all over the south coast. There was a feeling of nervous excitement as they met each other and filed into the briefing tent. The regional training centres were exciting, but this was Salisbury and it was huge. The army buildings looked clean, freshly painted and surrounded by a large drill square. The roads and paths were straight and everything was well ordered. The grass was cut to regulation length and all of the marker stones were painted a crisp and clean white. Men and women walked about, dressed like soldiers, real soldiers, wearing proper army clothes. They watched as soldiers saluted passing officers and everyone seemed to march and walk smartly. They were amazed at how many people were here, and just as they were led from the drill square into the briefing tent, they saw soldiers with real guns standing about, smoking and laughing, faces painted green or black. There were so many of them and more arriving by the minute, Several of the units were dressed in brown camouflage instead of the jungle green, looking tanned and leaner than the others. Just returned from Afghan or Iraq, probably, Simon Blowers said as they stood around. How do you know? asked Roy Tucker. Blowers stared at him before answering. They were in brown desert BDUs and they're tanned, so they've been somewhere hot and sunny, like a desert. The others laughed at this and started making fun of Tucker, the way men do when they are together and feel insecure about their surroundings. Why are there so many soldiers here all tooled up? asked Alex Cook. They start talking and throwing ideas in, everyone trying to be heard at the same time. Must be an exercise, said Blowers. What are those guns? Are they the SA-80s? asks Tucker again, who instantly gets bombarded with more jokes. Fuck me, Tucker, you're bright, ain't you? What do you think the British Army would be carrying? Well, I don't know, do I? Tucker replies with an innocent look. What unit are you joining, Tucker? Catering Corps. I want to be a chef. They burst out laughing and the jokes fly thick and fast. Someone pokes his podgy belly. Bloody hell, mate. You gonna leave any grub for the army? More laughs and someone from the back calls out. Tucker, you fat fucker! Roy Tucker has been called this all his life, through school and college and at work in the council office, and although the jibes sting, he laughs along and joins in the banter. Fuck you, at least I'll be warm and fed while you lot run around being Rambos. The men relax into easy banter and excited conversation, until a man with stripes on his sleeves walks in and shouts for them to be quiet. As soon as they hush, an officer walks to the front and addresses the group. Welcome to Salisbury, gentlemen. You're at the start of your first two-week basic training camp. You should have all received your uniforms and basic kit from your regional training centres. If you're missing anything or something doesn't fit, we can get that sorted first thing tomorrow. Now, normally, the first night here would be orientation, and then a few drinks in the mess to get to know one another. But we have a night exercise taking place, and your arrival fits in nicely. He gives a wicked grin, and the men look at him with excitement. As I'm sure you know, we have tank training and armoured vehicle training at this centre, and the mechanised infantry, regular infantry and various other regiments train alongside them. This gives us invaluable operational training prior to deployment. Tonight we have a very large exercise taking place and we are going to use you as civilians in the urban village training zone. You will be fully briefed as to what exactly is expected from you. But let me say this, this is a remarkable opportunity for you to see the British Army in action. There will be simulated fighting, firing and explosions, so I can imagine it will be a long and boring night for you. So just try and stay awake, please. The men laugh and start whispering in excited tones until the sergeant shouts for quiet. Now you will have to excuse me as I'm needed elsewhere, but we will get a chance to meet again tomorrow when we begin your basic training. Just one more thing. After the exercise, please do try and get some sleep. Trust me, you will need the rest. The officer leaves and the sergeant takes over, giving the brief for the night exercise. 
The men are told to stay in the houses and do exactly as they're told. They won't be using live rounds, so there's no risk of getting shot, but it will be dark and there will be lots going on, so if you walk around on your own, there is a real risk of injury. Do as you're told and enjoy the spectacle. We do not allow mobiles or cameras or you trying to take pictures and using flashes, so all of your phones and cameras will be left here. If any of you are caught with a phone, you will be discharged with immediate effect. The trainee recruits are led away. After a short time of waiting in the drill square, they're collected by old army trucks and moved down into the training area. The trucks are enclosed in the back, so the men have no idea of the direction or distance they're travelling in. None of them mind this, though, and all are laughing and talking about their good fortune, being involved in an actual exercise. Within a couple of hours, they're placed into small groups in the houses of the urban village training zone and told to stand around or sit on the furniture and wait for further instruction. The sense of excitement is palpable, and within a short time, they hear shots and loud explosions coming from the dark grounds all around them. Then, loud engines and heavy vehicles pass through the streets, and men are running behind them and taking position. They are firing weapons, and the bright flashes from the ends of the barrels are startling in the dark. The soldiers start at one end of the street and work their way down, house by house. There are soldiers firing back at them, and massive mock battles taking place with smoke grenades and explosions. The soldiers work the house clearance and find the trainee recruits. The recruits are made to kneel down at first and plastic cuffs are applied to their wrists, behind their backs. Then they are led outside, and after some time, the cuffs are removed, and they are led to the end of the street into a safe area. They wait as more of the trainee recruits are brought down until all thirty of them are there. Then the soldiers all move out and the vehicles go away. Officers and instructors speak to the recruits and tell them that they will have a hot debrief. The recruits all try to look serious, like they know what's going on. They're asked to declare any injuries and if they are happy to continue, and then they are led back into the houses ready unit to train house clearance. Then the shooting and explosions start again, and the recruits wait with anticipation for the soldiers to come and get them. There is more shouting this time, though, and the men seem to be yelling in confusion. The recruits hear soldiers shouting the word medic and screaming at each other. The trainee soldiers take this to be part of the exercise and watch as a soldier falls down in the street, clutching at a fake wound to his neck. Soldiers rush to him, and then the injured one jumps up and starts attacking them. They fight back and batter him down, but not before he bites into a few of them. A few of the recruits are too taken with the whole spectacle to understand that something is going wrong. Too many years spent watching action and horror movies. But Simon Blowers stands in his assigned house, looking out at the fighting, and knows that something is wrong. Simon had joined the exalted Royal Marines a few years ago, but a bad leg injury held him back, and he had to leave before getting even a few weeks into his basic training. Since then, he has absorbed anything to do with army life and has a greater understanding of the processes within the services. He watches as soldiers run around outside, some attacking each other. They're running past his assigned house, further into the street, and Simon knows they shouldn't advance until the houses have been cleared. Shortly after the mayhem starts, he sees mass hand-to-hand -hand fighting taking place. Soldiers are killing each other and biting into flesh. Then one of them bursts into the house he is in. Simon watches as the soldier comes towards him, fresh blood dripping from a ragged bite wound in his neck. Mate, are you alright? Simon says to the soldier, backing away as the man advances straight at him. Simon keeps backing away and shouting out to the soldier, and then he sees the red bloodshot eyes and yells out. The other recruits come downstairs. They've been watching the exercise from an upstairs window. They stop and stare in horror as Simon frantically tries to dodge the badly injured soldier. Blowers, what the fuck, mate? Fucking help me then, don't just stand there. What's he doing? Is he all right? Oi, mate, are you okay? The undead soldier turns at the new voices and advances towards them. Alex Cook is the furthest away, a fact that saves his life as the undead lurches at the nearest recruit and sinks his teeth into his face, pulling him to the ground. Fuck! Fuck! What's he fucking doing? Cook screams at Blowers. Blowers darts forward and kicks at the soldier's head, making him fall down. 
The soldier immediately tries to get up and rolls over, his face pressing against the arse cheeks of the recruit he toppled. The undead soldier then buries his face into the man's trousers and bites down, eliciting more screams from the recruit. You dirty fuck, don't bite his arse, he's biting his fucking arse! Cook stands in shock as Blowers kicks down at the head and keeps kicking until the undead lies motionless. Blowers then bends down and tries to pull the other recruit out from under the body. He's fucking dead. Blowers looks up to Cook. They both gaze out of the windows and at the carnage taking place outside. I'm out of here. Cook starts to run, followed by Blowers. They both run to the end, dodging round fighting soldiers and bodies on the ground. Shots and loud explosions are still sounding out as the soldiers try desperately to fight back against the increasing number of undead. The other recruits are at the safe zone, watching with fear. Some of them are crying. What do we do? Tucker cries out, having just seen blowers running towards them. Fucking leg it now! Get out of here, quickly! A soldier runs towards them, waving at them to run, but an undead grabs him from the side and pulls him down onto the ground, biting into his face. Then more undead dive into him, biting and gnashing as the soldier screams at the recruits. Run! Fucking run! The recruits start moving away. Then, as one, they turn and run into the darkness. They run along the road for a few minutes, then see more fighting and zombie soldiers ahead of them. Off the road! Quick! This way! Blowers heads into the darkness of the plains. They keep running for several minutes and then slow down to a jog until the noise of the fighting and the screams are left behind. They take cover behind a low hill, then sit on the ground, heavily panting. What the fuck was that? asks trainee recruit Roland McKinney. He is addressing his question to Julian Talley, who's sitting next to him. I don't fucking know. Is that part of the exercise? asks Tucker. No, it fucking isn't, you thick cunt. Darren Smith shouts at him, clearly panicking. What do we do? voices McKinney. Let's just wait here and keep low, replies Blowers. They try to get their breath back, terrified and sweating in the hot, dark night. A loud engine roars above them and a long metal barrel comes into view, followed by a huge army tank that rises up on the hill behind them. The tank teeters on the top and starts down straight towards them. They scatter off in different directions, but one is too slow, tripping over and getting caught under the tracks. He's pulverised instantly, his body bursting apart. The recruits scream as the tank goes over their friend. Then they see a man sticking out of the hole in the top of the tank. Another man is pinning him over the edge of the hole and biting into the back of his neck. The tank roars past them and keeps going toward the village. Did you fucking see that? Cook screams out. We need to keep going, Blowers shouts in response. A few rush towards the broken body that is left from the tank assault. He's gone! Leave him! We need to go! Now! Blowers shouts out and starts running further into the plains. The others respond, hastening to catch up with him. Where are we going? Cook shouts to Blowers. I don't fucking know, just keep running! Which way is the compound? Tally shouts, but none of them know and they just keep running. After ten minutes, they see lights and head towards them. There is a base set up there with some more tanks that are stationary. Camouflage netting is stretched over a field table. Maps and papers litter the tabletop. The recruits see movement between the lights and run forward, shouting and screaming for help. Then they see people running towards them, and Blowers and Cook at the front notice the oncoming soldiers' red eyes. Fuck! They both shout and run left and right. The oncoming undead soldiers run into the group and take down the nearest recruits, who scream and beg for help as they are bitten and savaged. Tally and McKinney run towards a recruit who is being pinned down. He's thrashing against an undead that is gorging on his face. They both kick and punch at the zombie until it falls away. Then they help the injured recruit to his feet and start running away from the lights. They get away and stop to rest in the dark, still hearing the screams from behind them. Soon, they are joined by more of the trainees as they lower the injured man down onto the ground. They feel for a pulse and check for a breath from the inert body. He's fucking dead! Tally cries out. McKinney drops down and starts doing chest compressions. Someone get some air into him! McKinney shouts at the watching men after a few minutes of pumping his chest. A recruit drops down and uses his sleeve to wipe the blood away from the man's mouth, then leans over and starts blowing air into his lungs. 
The injured man surges upright and the man giving the kiss of life thrashes at him as his lips are savaged by the newly made zombie. McKinney jumps back and they all start kicking at the man they were trying to save just moments before. He refuses to budge and keeps sinking his teeth further into the man's face. Fuck this, McKinney says before running away. The rest follow him, going deeper into the plains of the tank training ground. As that first night progresses, they lose several more of their new colleagues as zombies lurch out of the darkness and take them down. The plains are dark as they have no ambient light. The ground is rutted and undulating from years of accommodating the immensely heavy vehicles. On one occasion, the ground drops down in front of them and they fall into a small group of undead that are stooped over a freshly killed body. One of the terrified recruits trips over the body and falls down with a yell, and the zombies are on him instantly, devouring his exposed skin. By Saturday morning, they're exhausted, filthy, and very, very lost. They try resting in amongst the hills, and blowers posts lookouts to keep watch. The men are told to shout out when an undead appears in the grounds, then they all run off again and drop down when they can't run any more. During the afternoon, they find a prone body. They look around but couldn't see any of the zombies, so they approach the body and see that it is a zombie, groaning and twitching, but unable to get up or move. The back of its neck is severely injured, and there is blood all down the camouflage clothes. He's got a water bottle on his belt, Cook says, looking at the body. Fuck, we need to drink. Someone go and get it, Darren Smith says, turning to look at the group, his eyes settling on Tucker. Why me? Tucker asks, guessing that he'd been chosen. You're in the catering corps, so you're in charge of supplies, Tally says to him. Tucker looks round at the faces, hoping for a reprieve, but with none coming, he slowly edges forward to the body. Come up from behind him, Blowers calls out. Yeah, but you've done that before, Cook shouts, and a few of them snigger. Tucker reaches the body, gingerly stretches out, then pulls the bottle from the undead's belt. Then, standing up and grinning, he holds the bottle high. Tucker, watch out! Tally shouts as the undead rolls quickly towards Tucker's feet. Tucker staggers backwards and trips, going down onto his ass before scrabbling up with a whimper and running back to the men. As Tucker unscrews the bottle's cap and takes a sip, the rest of the men watch intently, making sure that he only takes a sip before handing the bottle on to the next man. Tally is the last to drink. Is there any left, Tally? Blowers asks him. Yeah, not much, though. We'll save it for later. That okay with everyone? They all look longingly at the bottle, but nod in agreement. The day is blisteringly hot, and the sun is beating down on the plain. The men find no shade, and they sweat freely, rapidly losing water and dehydrating. As night falls on Saturday, they hear what sounds like wolves howling into the night sky. The sound comes from all around them, and chills them to the bone. And so they get up and run again. The undead zombie soldiers chase them relentlessly through the hills and valleys, and it's only when one recruit falls down and is set upon that the others get away. They keep going throughout the night until they can go no further, and exhaustion makes them fall down. They stay safe for a few hours, until one of them screams out as his neck is bitten by his friend. The others run off, and again lose the undead in the gloom of the night. By Sunday morning, they need sleep, and so they nestle between a small collection of low hills. Lookouts are posted and rotated every hour. That afternoon, they spot the undead again in the distance and have to keep moving. The thirty that started off are picked off one by one until by Sunday night, there are just twelve remaining. As the sun comes up on Monday morning, they see the road in the distance and follow alongside it, still keeping low and using the hills to put spotters on and check the skyline. They've learnt more survival instincts in these two days than they ever would have during the two-week training camp. Eventually, after trudging for many miles, they see the compound buildings in the distance and work their way over. They get closer and see the hundreds of undead shuffling between the buildings. Most of them are grouped in the drill square and move aimlessly about. The trainee recruits watch and look for gaps, talking amongst themselves about the change in behaviour from the night time. They slowly creep forward and see a chance to get into a building by the near side of the drill square. In single file, they inch forward, closer and closer until they can see the door. Then, as one, 
They burst out and sprint the final distance, legs burning and lungs heaving for that last final stretch. As they reach the door, the closest undead turn and start shuffling towards them. The last recruit gets through the door and slams it shut, just as the whole horde from the drill square start moving across. Within minutes, the building is surrounded and they are standing around a cold water tap in the toilet room, quenching their raging thirst and then collapsing down onto the floor. Second Lieutenant Galloway Gibbs comes down the stairs, holding his head and clutching the handrail, stopping when he sees the filthy men dressed in civilian clothing. Before long, they are all in the classroom. Chapter 10 Dave and I stand and look at the lowered metal bar stretched across the road and the small sentry hut next to it. It has taken us several hours to find the road to the army training centre, but after many wrong turns and avoiding small groups of undead, we found it. Is this it? I look at Dave. Yes, I think so. It doesn't look like much. I was expecting something more high-tech than this. It looks like something from World War II. It probably is. Bloody hell. On the movies, they have big electric gates and cameras and stuff. Dave just looks at me silently for a few minutes, and I shrug back at him. The metal bar stretches across the road, and the guard hut is just a small wooden structure with glass windows and a large doorway. So, where's the guard? I asked Dave. Should be there, he points at the empty hut. We walk closer leaving the unmarked police car on the road. Dave had told me not to bring a weapon out, and he made sure to leave his knives in the car. We approach the hut and check inside, but it's definitely empty. There's a high wire fence topped with razor wire running off in both directions, and I can see buildings in the distance. So where's the switch for this thing? I asked Dave as I mooch about in the hut, then start examining the end of the metal bar. Dave walks over and pushes the heavy end down, and the smaller end lifts up with ease. It's manual. Oh, right. Well, are we driving in or walking? I personally think driving, so that we can get away if something horrible happens, which it invariably will. It seems to happen every half a bloody hour. Okay, we'll drive. We go back to the car and drive through, then decide to leave the barrier up so that we can make a fast escape if we need to. So, why is there just a single barrier there? It doesn't look that secure. There's always two guards at every entrance. Armed guards? Yes. We drive down the road, and after a few minutes, the buildings come into view. There are basic structures set around a massive drill square, and beyond the buildings, there is another road going into a vast open area. Are those the planes over there? I think so. So that must be where they do the tank training. Yes, Mr Howie. Well, I don't see any big vehicles here, so they must be somewhere else. Out there, maybe. Shit, look at that! I stop the car, and we both look down to the drill square, and the hundreds of undead gathered around a single building. The undead are all facing into the building, indicating there must be survivors inside, or that's the place they last saw a survivor. I fucking knew it. What did I say? Every half hour, something horrible happens. Fuck me, are they all soldiers? The entire undead massed horde are roughly dressed in the same way, in green and brown camouflaged army uniform of sorts. Some are wearing what looks to be battle dress with helmets on and twigs and branches stuck in the top. I reel back, amazed at the sight. That's a fucking army, that is. A fucking zombie army of the undead. I turn to look at Dave who is leaning forward and staring intently at the scene in front of us. None of the undead has seen us yet. We're still a ways off from them. I can't see another way round, Dave. The road just goes straight through them all. Look. Dave points at the building being surrounded by the undead. A window opens and a person leans out, waving something white at us. I get out and wave back, both my arms high up in the air. Dave, we'll have to do something. We can't just leave them there. OK, Mr Howie? Dave gets out and we both stand and look at the scene in front of us. Dave, do you know Morse code? Yes, Mr Howie. We could use the car headlights to signal to them. Would that work? Yes. 
I pull the car around so that the front of the car is facing towards the building, then show Dave how to operate the high beam on the headlights. It's daylight and very sunny, so hopefully the undead won't see us. They're all facing the other way anyway. Got the idea, mate? I think so. He gets into the driver's seat and starts pulling at the headlight stick. Quick on and off, then a longer on. Okay, all yours now, Dave. Keep going. Okay. He pauses for a few seconds, then looks up at me. What do you want me to say? I... I I don't know. Oh. Ask them how many there are in there. Okay. Dave starts pulling at the light stick and I watch the light flicker on and off. Then I look back to the building and watch as the man with the white thing goes back inside. Chapter 11 Sir! There's people over there, sir! Where are you? I'm right here, thank you, Private Cook. Now, what are you shouting about? Sir, there's a car just come down the road. They've seen us. How did they see us, Private Cook? Simon waved a hand towel at them through the window. That's very clever of private blowers, isn't it? Now let's have a look, shall we? Blowers comes out of the upstairs room and shouts down to the second lieutenant. Sir, they're signalling us. I think it's Morse code. They're using the car headlights. Second Lieutenant Galloway Gibbs goes into the room and watches out of the open window, trying not to look down at the hungry zombie faces staring up at him. Yes, I think you're right, private blowers. It does appear that they are trying to signal to us. Well. What are they saying, sir? How the bloody hell should I know? Your army intelligence, sir. Every intelligence officer is trained in Morse code. Galloway Gibbs panics, thinking furiously. He can't admit that he doesn't know Morse code, or they'll find out he isn't trained or even fully commissioned yet. Yes, of course. Well, some are, but not all of us, though. Things have changed and evolved, private blowers, and... um, Morse code training is a specialist training skill that only a few get these days. I have put in for it, of course, but you know what the army's like. Bloody waiting lists, eh? Right, sir. Well, how do we signal back? I'm an intelligence private blower, not a trained signalman. Use your imagination. I found this, sir. Galloway Gibbs turns to see Private Tally holding a torch out in front of him. He doesn't know Morse code, Tally, Blowers tells him. Oh. Tally lowers the torch and goes back out of the room. Does anyone know Morse code? Tally booms out into the hallway. More of the men appear from rooms looking sleepy and dishevelled. What? Why? Darren Smith asks. There's a car up on the road. It's using the headlights to signal to us. Does anyone know Morse code? The officer will. He's an intelligence. I thought they all got trained, Smith answers. No, apparently not. Tally glances at Tucker as he walks into the open hallway. I used to do it at Scouts, Tucker offers. Tucker, well done, mate. Come and have a go. It was years ago, though. I don't remember it, he stammers, suddenly nervous. Just try, Tucker, Smith shouts to him. Tucker climbs the stairs and enters the room behind Tally. Tucker said he used to do Morse code in the Scouts, sir. Well done, Private Tucker. Where's that torch? Tally hands the torch to Tucker, who goes over to the window and looks out at the car's flashing lights. Uh, bloody hell, hang on. Tucker looks into the lens of the flashlight and presses the on button, then reels back from the retina burn of the bright light. Tucker, you fucking idiot, shine it at them, not yourself, Tally shouts at him. I was making sure that it works, Tucker replies then points the flashlight at the car and starts pressing the light on and off rapidly. So what's he saying, Private Tucker? The officer asks. I don't know yet, sir. I'm asking him to start the message again. The car lights go off for a few seconds, then start blinking with short and longer bursts. Tucker's mouth moves as he tries to keep up with the letters being signalled to him. Shit, I lost it. I need a pen and paper. Private Tally, go and get Private Tucker something to write with, please. Tally shoots out of the room, calling for pen and paper, and returns within seconds armed with several pens and pads from a nearby office. Here you are, mate. No, I'll call out the letters and you write them down. Okay, mate, ready when you are? 
Tucker flashes back to the car, asking them to start again. The car lights go out, and then, after several seconds, they start flashing, and Tucker calls the letters out. H O W M A N Y. Oh, what does that spell? He looks at Tally. How many? Tally responds. How many what? Galloway Gibbs demands from Tucker. I don't know, sir. That's all he sent. How many of us, probably? Blowers says without looking round. Yes, thank you, Private Blowers. I'm sure we could have worked that out for ourselves. Well, Tucker, answer the man and make sure you tell him there's an officer here as well. Can't I just tell him there are 13 of us, sir? No, Private Tucker, you cannot. They need to know an officer of the British Army is in this building, so tell them. The officer stares at Tucker, just as Tally and Blowers shrug their shoulders. Tucker turns back to the window and starts flashing the torch again. He says 13 and something else, but I can't make it out, Mr Howie. OK, so there are 13 of them in there. Wow, that's a lot. Why are they hiding and not fighting their way out? I don't know, Mr Howie. There's a lot of zombies, but still 13 of them, and especially if they're soldiers. Right, we need a plan. I look at Dave. We could lead them away. No, mate, it's already late and it'll take bloody hours to lure away a group like that. It'll be nice to get through them and get one of those APS vehicles and then come back. APC. Yeah, th that's what I meant. But we can't get through them without a fight. I sense Dave looking at me. I think I've just used his favourite word and his ears pricked up like a child being offered sweets. I can't help feeling the urge too, though. That feeling of battle is amazing. In the last two days, I've become addicted to it. I start to smile and feel the adrenaline coursing through my system. Well, Dave, a fight it is, then. There it is again, that small smile on his face. It lights him up. How can I say no to such a nice man? Are we driving down or walking, Dave? Walk, then we can drop them as we go. Good idea, chum. Walking it is, then. Now, do I take the axe or not? Axe or shotgun? Axe or shotgun? I weigh both of them in my hands, trying to decide. Take both, Mr Howie. You think so? You'll need it when we get close. You won't have time to reload. Fair point, mate. Both, then. I put the bag onto my back and tighten the straps, then drop the axe down so that the head is resting on the top of the bag and the handle is hanging down. Don't trip up this time, Mr Howie. I won't, mate. And if you do, try to shoot them this time. OK, mate. I take the plastic carrier bag that Dave fashioned into a shotgun cartridge holder and loop it through my belt. Then I fill it with shotgun cartridges. Are you taking the rifle or the other shotgun, Dave? The rifle, Mr Howie, and the knives. I thought you might. Dave puts the Tesco fleece on and loads up the pockets with ammunition strips for the Lee Enfield 303 rifle. Mr Howie, can I use your bag to put some ammunition in and my knives? Of course, mate, no problem. Dave goes behind me, and I feel as he rummages about in the side pockets and puts ammunition in them. I turn my head as he slides his two favourite straight-bladed knives into the elastic mesh at the front of the bag. Ready, mate? Yes, Mr Howie. Just stay to my left, please, so I can reload from your bag. OK, got it. We both take a long drink of water and then start walking down towards the horde. What the bloody hell are they doing? Are they mad? Second Lieutenant Charles Galloway Gibbs shouts out in surprise as the two men leave the car and walk towards them. There's only two of them. They'll be slaughtered, he says, more to himself than the other men. They're armed, though, sir. What, with one gun each against hundreds of those things down there? They must be bloody mad. At least they're trying, Blowers thinks to himself. The road is set higher than the parade square and the building beyond, so we have to walk down a slope. I can't help smiling at the absurdity of it. Two of us against an actual army of zombies, armed with one rifle, one shotgun, two knives and one axe. Fuck me, we must be mad. I chuckle to myself and Dave looks across. Are you OK, Mr Howie? Oh, yes, mate, never felt better. 
Let's start picking them off, then we can move left and spread them out a bit over that big car park and give those blokes inside a chance to break out. It's a parade square. What is? That big car park. It's a parade square. Oh, OK. We can spread them out over the parade square then, you picky bugger. We both stop and Dave raises the rifle, then scans along the horde from left to right and then back to the middle. He looks down at the shotgun in my hands. Just a bit closer. OK, mate, say when. We walk for another few seconds until Dave judges the distance is effective for the shotgun. Then we both stop again and he looks at me. Ready, Mr Howie? I always ask that. Oh, sorry. That's OK, mate. Ready, Dave? Yes, Mr Howie. I raise the shotgun to my shoulder and fire both barrels into the crowd. As soon as the first barrel opens up, Dave is firing the rifle. I watch several of the undead drop from the spread of the shotgun pellets. I reload quickly and fire into them again. Dave is firing rapidly, aiming his shots and picking them off one by one. I take a second between reloading to watch his shots, and even from this range, nearly all of them are headshots. Dave fires and pulls the bolt back, then fires again. The action repeated over and over as shiny brass shells are expended and launched out of the breach. The undead have started to turn now and are shuffling towards us. I keep loading and firing and at this range I'm dropping several with each shot. I don't expect to kill them but at least they're knocked over which will thin them out a bit. We move forward slowly firing and reloading. Dave pulling the strips of bullets from his pockets and slotting them down into the rifle, then pulling the bolt and firing. As we get closer, I can see just how many there are. Several hundred of them. We're whittling away at them, and more drop with each shot. I can see the effect of the shotgun now that we're closer. They're torn apart and flung backwards by the power of it. Move left! Dave shouts out and we both start stepping left as we fire. The horde reacts and starts to follow us. The plan works slowly and they begin stringing out from the densely packed crowd. We keep firing and dropping them from the front. Bodies are laying all about and we are doing good work. But for every one we drop, several more shuffle into view. After several minutes, Dave pats his pockets and shouts, Ammunition! I drop down with one knee in the ground and keep firing as Dave gropes in the bag and pulls out more clips. He pushes more shotgun cartridges into my belt bag. Thanks, mate. We maintain this position for a few minutes, with me kneeling down and Dave standing to my right. They are much closer now, and the shotgun pellets have less distance and are therefore less spread out. But the effect at this range is devastating, and they are hammered backwards, with bits of undead bodies flying off. The undead dropped at the front create an obstacle for those following, and many trip over the bodies, which creates more gaps between them as they struggle to get back up. No sign of any super zombies then, I say to Dave as we both reload. Not yet, Mr Howie. And then we're back, firing and firing into them and watching as undead zombie soldiers are mown down by the rifle and the shotgun. Heads explode as the bullets enter their foreheads and rip out the back of the skull, showering the closest zombies with bits of grey matter. Deadly shards of bones from the skulls fly off too and are embedded into more undead brains and flesh. I'm almost out, Dave! Move back! We step more to the left, creating distance from the slow-moving horde. I drop down again and Dave rummages through the bag and hands me more cartridges. That's it! I pick my shots, aiming into the densest part of the crowd, trying to use the full effect of the shotgun. Within seconds, though, the ammunition is gone. I'm out! Dave fires a few more times, then loops the rifle strap over his shoulder and neck so that it's secure on his back. He runs around to the back of me as I release the chest and waist clips, then Dave pulls the bag down and hands me the axe. Leave the shotgun here with the bag, we'll come back for it, I say to Dave as I take the axe from him. Dave draws the knives from the front of the bag and we start moving back to the right, following the path we've just taken. The horde is slow to react and I can see that they are strung out, coming away from the building. We've killed many of them and more are wriggling on the ground, tangled with the bodies they've tripped over. We keep moving until the building is in front of us. The men inside are all staring out of the windows. 
Ready, Dave? Yes, Mr. Howie. Let's have it then. We both roar out and charge forward into the undead, my axe raised and ready. I see Dave lean forward with his arms out behind him, then leap and spin through the air, driving the knives into the back of an undead soldier's neck. The heat of battle is upon me once again, and I chop down at my first undead soldier, and the axe slices through his skull. I pull back and move forward again, swinging out and chopping zombies down as they lunge forward at me. Come on! I roar at them. Come to me, you fuckers! I lash out, left and right, cleaving a path through the bodies. Blood sprays out and I'm soaked by the spray back. Dave is twirling and dancing through them, flowing like water and slicing the blades across jugulars and stabbing through the necks and into the spinal columns. I see two come at him, one from the front and one from behind. Dave drops down onto his back and sticks the blades up into their heads, driving the knives into their brains. Then he is up and onto the next one. My aiming is getting better with the axe, and I use less power and more skill now, judging the blow and conserving the energy. But still the axe destroys them. The sharp blade rips flesh apart, and the blunt end smashes their skulls in. Chapter 12 Fucking look at them go! Jesus fucking Christ! Blowers is up on his feet, staring at the two men who have just shot down many of the zombie soldiers while drawing them away from the building. Fuck me, look at the small bloke with those knives! Have you ever seen anything like that? Tally yells out, equally excited. Fuck this, I'm going to join in and get some. Blowers starts for the door, but 2nd Lieutenant Galloway Gibbs blocks his path. Private Blowers, you will stand down. They have hundreds to get through yet, and they will not make it. They're bloody trying, though, sir, and we could help. That lot are all facing the other way. We can attack from the rear, sir, Blowers screams out, desperate to join the fight. Do not question my orders, Private. Now do as you are told. Blowers had only been in the Royal Marines for a very short time, but he'd met officers, and they didn't talk to people like this. His face hardens, and he stares at the officer. Blowers observes the officer swallow nervously while still maintaining that superior sneer. Sir? With all due respect, you can fuck off. Blowers pushes past the stunned officer, shoving him out of the way. Tally and the others quickly follow. Tucker tries to push past and looks at the officer. Sorry, sir. Excuse me, sir. Tucker squeezes through and runs down the stairs with his mates. Grab anything you can use. Blowers yells at them and grabs at a long metal pole used for opening the top windows. The men rush around, finding anything that can be used as a weapon. Wooden chairs, a coat stand, a couple of them turn the classroom tables over and pull the thick wooden legs off. Tucker tries to find something and comes back with a spatula from the kitchen. Blowers shakes his head and looks at the assembled men. We only met a few days ago, but this lot of fuckers have killed our mates and those two blokes are fighting to get to us. We are going to go out there and fuck them up. Got it? The men nod, faces stern and ready. Then they pull the doors open and pour out into the battle, roaring with the charge. I keep killing them, and they keep coming. We're slowly beating a path towards the building line, but the undead are dense here, and the battle gets harder. I keep having to move backwards in order to create space. Dave is now just a couple of steps behind me, and we are almost fighting back to back, slowly getting surrounded. I'm thinking this might have been a bad idea, Dave. So what place is, Mr. Howie? We spin around so that Dave is facing towards the building and I can cover his back with the range of the axe. Stay with me, Dave roars and starts slashing his way through. Zombies are dropping down like flies from the amazing speed of his arms. He roars and shouts as he attacks them. I swing the axe out battering them away and moving backwards to keep up with Dave. The progress is better now. We're making headway. More undead soldiers lurch at me, and I drive the axe down on them, then swing back out and knock more down, desperate to get space. Dave is still going, slashing left, right and forward, and the body count keeps going up as his arms whirl through the air, his face slick with blood. Then I hear loud shouting, and I glance around to see men bursting out of the building holding a collection of weapons. One fat lad has a spatula in his hand. 
They charge into the back of the undead horde, and we fight with renewed energy as both sides slaughter a path to each other. I scream out and join Dave at the front, lashing out with the axe, battering and cleaving the bodies. Dave is screaming and slashing them down, and within seconds, we get to the men. Go inside, Dave bellows at them, and they react instantly to his drill sergeant voice, falling back and running into the doorway. One lad stays, fighting and battering at the zombies with a metal pole, screaming abuse and lashing out. I run up behind him and grab the back of his shirt and start pulling him back. Move back! Get inside! I scream at him, and he allows me to pull him back inside the building and slam the door shut. We all slump down on the floor, gasping for breath. Even Dave looks flustered for once, and he is sweating heavily as his chest heaves. I lean back against the wall and slide down, the axe resting by the side of me. The men recover quicker than us, but then we did a lot more fighting than them. Good work, lads, I say to them. Thanks for the help. The eager faces look at me and the fat lad rushes off and comes back a few seconds later with a large glass of water. He hands it to Dave. Mr Howie first, Dave pants and gestures towards me. The guys look at me keenly and I note they are all in normal clothes and not army uniform. Thanks, Dave. I take the water and down it in one, then hand the glass back and the lad rushes off to get more. Bring two glasses this time, Tucker, one of the men shouts as he disappears into the kitchen. He comes back with two glasses of water and we sit and drink, trying to get our breathing back under control. I wipe the sweat out of my eyes and my arm comes away all bloody. That was fucking amazing, one of the men says to me. Then they all join in, offering thanks and praise to both of us. I hold my hand up. Really, it's nothing. Just trying to help. That was nothing. You killed loads of them. That was fucking awesome. Well, we were starting to struggle at the end there, eh, Dave? Yes, Mr Howie. Glad you came out when you did. I catch the glances again as they hear Dave call me Mr Howie. Not again. I try to intercept before the name sticks. I'm Howie, and this is Dave. We get a chorus of responses, and one of the men stands up in front of me and offers his hand, the same lad I had pulled away. Thank you, Mr Howie. I shake his hand. Fuck it, I bloody knew that would happen again, but I'm too exhausted to argue. I'll tell them later. I'm Blowers, Simon Blowers. He repeats the action with Dave, and I watch with amusement as Dave gives a very quick handshake, then wipes his hand down his trousers. I get to my feet and offer my hand to the next one, and I keep going, knowing they will respond, and then offer to shake Dave's hand. I smile as he stares at me, and then wipes his hand between each shake. And who exactly are you, gentlemen? A posh man comes down from the stairs, and I look up to see him, Tall, with slicked back hair, he's wearing a smart green uniform, not the camouflage dress of the soldiers outside. Hello, I'm Howie. Nice to meet you. I walk towards him with my hand outstretched. He gets to the bottom of the steps and looks down at my blood-soaked hand with disdain. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, mate. I wipe my hand down the back of my trousers and offer it again. He accepts with a very limp grip. Lieutenant Charles Galloway Gibbs of the British Army Intelligence Corps. He drops my hand and I can see that he is itching to wipe his, but is too well-mannered to do it in front of me. Now, I asked you a question. Who are you? I stare back at him quizzically. I just told you. I'm Howie and this is Dave. Where are you from? He speaks slowly with a patronising sneer. I'm from Boroughfair. Why? I mean, what regiment are you from? I'm not from a regiment. This bloke is a prick and has irritated me already. The flush of battle is still on me and I can't help but get bridled by his rude manner. You're not from a regiment? Then what, may I ask, are you doing here? We've come to steal an APS. APC, Dave calls out from behind me. We've come to steal an APC and then we saw you lot were in here so we thought we'd help. Dave joins me and stands smartly in front of the officer, then, surprisingly, he salutes. Sir, Dave states crisply. The officer looks at Dave and turns to me. Not from a regiment? 
No, I just told you, I'm from Boroughfair. He looks like a soldier to me, the officer gestures to Dave. He was, I'm not. I speak slowly, angry at the incredibly rude manner of the man. I turn my back on him and look to the men who are standing around the hallway, all of them watching me with interest. So there are thirteen of you, is that right? They nod at me, and I can see them glancing back at the officer. Fuck him. I'm not in the army and I don't have to be polite to him. So are you all soldiers then? Kind of, Simon Blowers replies. We've just joined the TA. We only arrived on Friday for our first two-week camp. Do not turn your back on me. I was talking to you, the officer speaks from behind me. You were speaking to me rudely, that's what you were doing, mate. And after what we just did, do not call me mate. I am an officer in the British Army and you do not call me that word. I spin round. At any other time, I might have been able to swallow it and remain polite, but the adrenaline is still in me and I lose my temper and jab my finger into his chest, driving him back into the classroom. You are fucking rude. That's what you are, mate. Now me and Dave here have just fought through a shitload of zombie soldiers to try and help you, and all you can do is sneer and patronise me. The officer looks scared, but he shouts back at me, his face flushing red. Do not touch me! I am an officer! You men! He points at the men in the hallway. Arrest him now! He has assaulted an officer! The men just stare at each other. Looks of amazement on their faces. If you do not arrest him now, I will have you all shot when the rest of the army arrives. A couple of them step forward, clearly scared by the threat. Dave gently steps in front of them and shakes his head. There is no army. There's nothing out there. Every city, town and village we've been through has fallen. Those things are everywhere. The whole country and the whole of Europe is gone. There's no army, no police, nothing. The men stare in horror at me. What did you think was going on? That this was just here in this place? No, lads, I'm sorry, but it's all gone. A few of them reel back, clearly thinking of families and friends, their homes and loved ones. Even the officer goes quiet and stares off into space, and then he looks at me and speaks softly. How do you know this? I watched it happen. The whole of Europe got infected within a few hours. God knows how it happened so fast, but it did. And now it's here. There are a few survivors, but not many. A tear falls down his cheek and he slumps down into one of the classroom chairs and starts sobbing loudly into his hands. I pull the door closed and turn back to face the gathered men. A few of them are crying quietly and some have slumped down against the walls. The ones at the front don't show a reaction, though, and I note the hard looks on their faces, especially from the one called Blowers. There is a long silence, and then I look over at Dave, who has assumed his usual expressionless look. He is covered in blood and bits of body. I step over and pick a small chunk of grey matter and white bone from his shoulder. Then it gets stuck to my fingers and I try to shake it off, but the bloody thing won't go and I flick at it with my other hand, but it gets stuck to that next, like a sticky bogey. I keep shaking my hand, but it won't budge, and I have to start waving my hand vigorously. Get the fuck off my hand! I keep shaking and spinning round, then try to wipe it with the other hand, and again it gets stuck. Oh, for fuck's sake! Then I look up and remember where I am. Twelve faces are watching me in silence, and even Dave has turned and is looking at me. Sticky bit of brain won't come off. I hold my hand up to show them, then drop my hand down and wipe it on the back of my trousers. Uh, Is there a bathroom? I could really do with getting cleaned up a bit. Blower steps forward. Follow me, sir. I'll show you where it is. Uh, Cheers, mate. You coming, Dave? You look like a right bloody mess too. A few minutes later, Dave and I are standing at wash basins, scrubbing our hands clean. Blowers went back downstairs, saying he would wait with the others. I wait a couple of minutes and close the door. Who is that officer? What did he say he was? He said he was a lieutenant from Army Intelligence. What's a lieutenant? It's a lieutenant, like the Americans have. 
It's spelt the same, we just pronounce it differently. Why? Don't know, Mr Howie. Is a lieutenant a high up rank? He's a second lieutenant, which means he's just joined. He hasn't got the full marks on his uniform yet, so he must be an OIT. What's that? Officer in training. So he's a newbie too, just like the rest of them. Yes. He's still a pompous fucking dick. Dave stays quiet. I guess his former life means he won't badmouth an officer. I hold back from saying any more so I don't offend him. Dave left his bag in the car, and mine is out there too amongst the undead army. So instead of his normal ritual of antiseptic cleansing wipes, he's making do with army soap and water. We scrub and clean the blood from our hands and faces. The front of my shirt is sticky, and I take it off to rinse under the taps. The water runs pink, and I catch my reflection in the mirror where the blood has soaked through onto my upper body. I use paper towels from a dispenser and try to clean it off as best as possible. Dave copies me and starts rinsing out his clothes too. First the Tesco fleece, then his underneath top. We wring them out and spin them around in the bathroom, water flying off. We soak the ceiling from the spray. They had windows open up here, didn't they? I walk out and head across the landing to the rooms where they were leaning out to signal us. The weather is still gloriously warm and we drape our tops over the window sills to dry out. We slump down into the chairs in the room and I pick up the bit of paper they used to decipher Dave's Morse code. I show him and he nods back. Is that smoke? I sniff the air and start to get up. Dave, can you smell smoke? He nods and we both start down the stairs. The smell of smoke is strong now and we can hear voices coming from one of the rooms. I push the door open and find another classroom, much like the other one. The lads all stare around looking guilty. They've pushed the tables and chairs back and started a small fire in the middle of the concrete floor. A large pan of water is resting on a metal frame, rigged up over the flames. The lads stare at Dave and I, standing there, shirtless. Tucker rigged this up, sir. We thought you might fancy a brew. One of them points at the fat lad that ran out with the spatula and then got us the water. Bloody hell, mate. Well done. That's brilliant. Where did you learn that? Tucker swells with pride and a big smile spreads over his face. The other lads visibly relax and start smiling at each other. In the scout, sir, I used the metal frames from the chairs and just bent them up a bit. I won't get in trouble for that, will I? What, for breaking a couple of chairs? You should be more worried about replacing that spatula if I were you. Some of the lads start laughing and the atmosphere slowly changes. What the bloody hell were you going to do with a spatula, Tucker? One of them calls out and then more join in until Tucker pulls the spatula from his back pocket and waves it at them jokingly. I've still got it, so watch out. Tucker swipes at the closest lad and hits him with the flat part of the metal head. Oi, sorry, chef. I feel a bit awkward without my top on. I know it's all lads, but still. Dave must have sensed my discomfort because he nipped away, then came back with two lightweight green camouflage jackets. Ah, well done, Dave. I shrug the coat on and do the zip half up. Dave pulls his on and pulls the zip all the way to the top. Where did you find them? One of the lads asks. Cook, I think his name is. We looked everywhere for Kit. Kit gets nicked if it isn't hidden. Dave answers. Within a few minutes, we're all seated and Dave and I get the first steaming mugs of black tea, Tucker apologising profusely for not having any milk. It's fine, mate, don't worry. I take an appreciative sip of the tea to show my gratitude and almost scald my mouth in the process. So, lads, fill us in on what happened here. Blowers starts off, but soon others join in. Thirty of you to start with? Bloody hell, that's awful. I'm really sorry for your loss. What about you, sir? What happened out there? I explain about how the event started and then spread across Europe. I tell them that what I heard about the forts and London being infested, then about travelling through Portsmouth and how horrific the devastation was. A few of them look down and start crying again when I mention Portsmouth, and I realise, too late, that they must be from there. Sorry, lads. It's better you know the truth, though. 
After a long pause, only broken by Dave taking repeated loud sips from his tea, Cook looks over. So, what happens now? Now? What do you mean? Well, what do we do now? Lads, I'm not here to tell you what to do. We came to steal an APC so that we can get through London. We'll get that and then be off. Why are you going to London? One of them asks. For my sister. She left a message just as the outbreak started. She's locked herself in her flat, so I'm going to get her and then head to the forts. Dave coughs. Sorry, we are going to get her and head to the forts. How are you going to get one, sir? They're all down on the plains for the exercise. Well, I guess we'll go down there then. We've come this far. Sir, there are hundreds of them down there. Those ones were just waiting their turn for the exercise. There's shitloads more down there. Far more. Blower says. I look at Dave, who carries on sipping his tea. What do you think, mate? I reckon it's worth it. Okay, Mr Howie. Mind you, we've got no ammunition left, so it's down to the axe and the knives again. It'll be a hard one, but there's still a few hours of light left. Okay. A few of the lads watch us intently, some open-mouthed. Fucking hang on a minute. A sudden realisation hits me. This is the army. There must be loads of guns and things. In the armoury? Fuck it, let's go and get them then. I'm all excited and raring to go again. You can't, sir. The armoury is fully locked up, Cook says. Oh, is it? Well, we can just unlock it then, somehow. Locked? Dave asks Cook. The lieutenant told us. It's not locked, Dave says. How do you know? I ask him. There was an exercise on. It wouldn't be locked. They would need it to be ready for resupply. Ha! Even better then. Right, where is it? I ask the lads, but they just stare back blankly, and a few of them shrug their shoulders. Oh yeah, I forgot, you're all new. Dave, do you know where it is? No, but it won't be hard to find, Mr Howie. Okay, good, we've got a plan. Shall we? I ask Dave. What about us, sir? What should we do? I look around at the expectant faces. They have no idea where they are or where to go. I don't want to lose valuable time, but I understand that they must be terrified. Listen, lads, it's up to you what you do. I know that you've learnt the difference between zombies in the day and night. Well, my advice is to avoid them at all costs during the hour of darkness. But during the day, they become slow and they can be attacked like that lot out there. We wouldn't have done that during the night. We wouldn't have stood a chance. Having said that, we were fighting a load this morning and one of them grabbed my axe when I was going for him. He wasn't like the others. He looked more switched on. Maybe he was a one-off, but it's something to keep in mind. Now, if you want to go back to your homes and families, then go for it. But remember what I said. It's a horrible, brutal thing to say but there are very few survivors. And it's already been a few days, so, well, it's up to you. But we're all going to need weapons, and we're safe for fighting together. So I think we should all go for the armoury, and then you must go where you want from there. Most of them nod, and I can see that they are in agreement. It makes sense if we stick together and fight our way through that lot. Those of you who are up for it will meet you in the hallway in a couple of minutes. Grab some weapons, I look at Tucker. Maybe something a bit better than a spatula though, mate. I leave the room and head back up the stairs. My top is not quite dry, and the material clings to my skin as I put it on. Dave comes in and gets his on too. I quite like this jacket. Should we keep them? He nods, and we put them back on over the damp shirts. I walk out into the hallway and go through the corridor opening doors until I find the officer at a desk, his head resting in his hands. Uh, are you all right? He looks up. His slick-backed hair isn't so slick-backed now. It sticks up in a mess. He's not saying anything. We're going for the armoury, and then we'll try finding one of those big vehicles. You coming? He still doesn't reply, but just keeps on staring. Listen, mate, I know this is all a shock, but you're still an officer and those lads could do with some leadership. Why don't you come with us? Still no reply. Well, what are you going to do then? Just sit here and wait? Mate, 
Nobody is coming. If there is any army left, they will be holed up somewhere trying to survive like everyone else. Okay, look, I don't have time to waste. If you're coming, then we'll be leaving in about two minutes. Dave is waiting for me at the top of the stairs, and I shake my head at him. He nods back and we both go down. All of the recruits are there, armed with an assortment of weapons, mainly wooden table legs. They all look up expectantly as Dave and I walk down to them. We stop and stare back. Listen, lads, they're slow now, but don't stand and fight them. We just need to get through, that's all. Once we're in the open, we can move much quicker than them. Just watch out for any weirdo super zombies doing crossword puzzles. A couple of them smile back and I hear a few sniggers. Nervous excitement is running through them. Dave starts to talk. Strike and move. Keep moving and keep a firm grip of your weapon. Strike and move. Do you understand me? Dave barks at them and I'm surprised at the harsh tone of his voice. He moves into the crowd and shows them how to grip the clubs with both hands. Strike down onto the head. Your objective is to get through them, so only strike when you need to, but do not hesitate. They lunge quickly at the last second. Do not let them get their mouths anywhere near you. Do you understand? He moves between them, raising the clubs and adjusting their grips. A few mutter back at him. Strike and move! Do you understand? His voice booms into the confined room, and some of them jump from the sudden noise. More of them respond, though, and shout, Yes, sir! I am not a sir! He is a sir! And he points to me. I am Dave! Do you understand? Yes, Dave! What? Yes, Dave! They scream out. Good, Dave says and comes back to my side. The men are pumped up and ready. I whisper over to Dave. I'm not Sir. I'm just Howie. Everyone is already calling me Mr. Bloody Howie because of you. Yes, Mr. Howie. That glint is in his eye again. Right, where's my axe? Here, sir. Blowers hands it to me, and it's been cleaned too. Thanks, mate. Now, which way are we going, Dave? The drill square first. Got it. Do you want to lead? He hesitates for a second, which I take full advantage of. Too late. I'm closest to the door, so I'm going first. Yes, Mr. Howie. I look round at the nervous faces and realise just how much I've changed in a few short days. I look at Dave and smile. Ready, Dave? Yes, Mr. Howie. I wrench the door open and charge out, roaring as the adrenaline pumps into my system. Dave is right behind me and launches himself straight into them, going off to one side and whirling his knives at their throats. I swing out and smash zombie skulls with my glorious axe. The third battle today, and I still feel the fury and rage within me as I destroy them one by one. The bodies are packed in here, but the axe and Dave's knives soon clear some space and we fight out. I hear more roars behind me as the recruits spill out of the building, charging into the packed horde. The wooden clubs are smacking them down, and undead bodies are falling to the ground all around us. This feels amazing, having so many fighting together, fighting as one, as a team toward a common goal. The glory of battle surges through me, and I give a fresh roar and plough further into them. The recruits respond and I can hear screams and guttural roars from all around me as we take them down. Dave is spinning and dropping more bodies than any of the rest of us, but we surge forward and the zombies are beaten back by the sheer ferocity of the attack. Fourteen of us charge in and fourteen of us batter and beat them, killing and destroying anything in our path. This is one of the best feelings I have ever had. We are unstoppable. We are an army come to wreak vengeance on the zombie soldiers. Within seconds, I'm coated in blood again as the decaying grey faces loom up in front of me, waiting for me to cleave their skulls open. Three of them come from my left, all in a row. I pull the axe back and give a mighty heave, driving the blunt end into the closest one. He barrels into the next one and they all stagger down, only to be clubbed by recruits coming behind me. I glance back and watch the young men fighting. 
Some of them are clearly filled with the roar of the battle and are madly clubbing the zombies down. A few of the recruits look petrified, though, and are clutching the clubs to their chests and trying to stay away from the zombies. One of them is crying and whimpering, visibly shaking from head to toe. A zombie soldier lurches at him. I shout a warning, but it's too late and he goes down. Dave and I both run back towards him and attack the zombie, but all in vain. The zombie has bitten into the recruit's neck and blood is spraying out over the ground. Another one of the young lads rushes to his side and tries to pull him up. As Dave goes back into the battle, It's too late! Keep going! I shout at him. He stares blindly at me, and I push him forward into the gap created by Dave and the recruits who have fought their way to the front. We burst out of the horde, and suddenly there is space in front of us. Those out first turn and fight to the sides, driving the zombie soldiers back until all of the recruits are through, and we run to the drill square. It was a short but very intense battle, and nearly all of them are breathing hard. The last two days must have drained them. They must be close to exhaustion. They certainly look worn down. We keep pushing them over to the far side of the drill square and let them flop down on the ground to recover for a few minutes as Dave scans the buildings around the area. I'm bent over with my left hand resting on my knee, the still dripping axe in my right. There are so many undead bodies on the ground now. I look around to the recruits. Blowers and Cook are jubilant and high-fiving some of the others. Even Tucker looks pumped up and is joking. A few of them remain silent and clearly terrified. It's strange how the instinct for survival differs between people. Some, like the officer, will hide or go into shock, unable to process what they have lost and what's going on around them. Others will follow the pack, and even though they don't want to fight, the fear of being left alone makes them move. Then there are those that will fight even when they are terrified. They can see what must be done and will do it, because they have to. Then there are Blowers, Cook, Smith, Tally, McKinney and Tucker, taken into a fight out of necessity, and they relished every second of it. I can see it on their faces now as they relive the battle and joke about how the heads exploded and the brains came out. Some of the others are looking up to them and trying to joke along too, but I can see the conflicting emotions in them. They look at Blowers and Cook and laugh but then they glance at each other for reassurance. They have just killed what had been people, soldiers, what they want to be, what they now are. I look back up at the car and realise what Dave and I did. Examining my own feelings now, I know that as soon as I saw them, I wanted to be in there, hurting them and breaking them apart. We probably could have found a way around them, but I was glad that we hacked through instead. What does that say about me? The anger and fury I felt when I discovered my parents must have been killed woke something inside me. I don't know if it will ever go away now. I realise that Dave has joined me while I was deep in thought. You okay, Dave? Yes, Mr Howie. We probably could have found a way round them, don't you think? Probably. But we didn't. No. Do you enjoy it? What? The killing. The fighting. He pauses for a second and looks me in the eye. Do you, Mr Howie? There it is. I've been honest to myself. But can I be honest to another human being and say I do enjoy it? We hold eye contact and I know that I don't need to answer. I don't need him to answer either. I start to smile at him. Let's get them guns, mate. He smiles back and turns back to scanning the buildings. Weapons. What? We don't call it a gun, we call it a weapon. You're a picky bugger, Dave, so which building is it? That one. He points to the left. There are a row of buildings facing the parade square. They are bigger than the ones on the side where we rescued the recruits. Dave points at a large building in the middle of them. How do you know? The armoury is always central, so that everyone can get to it quickly. The undead soldiers are shuffling over towards us, but our route is clear. Right, lads, you ready? We need to move! I turn and shout to the recruits, who slowly stand up and stretch their weary muscles. They look ready to drop, and it's clear they need food and rest, and very soon. These lads are fucked, mate, I say to Dave. We don't have time to rest, Mr Howie. Yeah, I say slowly with a pang of guilt. 
Let's get him going then. Right, let's move it. They respond immediately to Dave's drill sergeant voice booming at them, moving listlessly towards the buildings. Chapter 13 Dave was right, and we're able to gain entry by simply forcing an external door. I can't help but wonder why the soldiers didn't take weapons from here, if they thought they were under attack. But then, the undead and injured were their colleagues and mates, so I guess they just simply didn't think of it as an attack. The building leads into a hallway with a long counter and a wall behind it. From the setup, I guess the soldiers line up at the counter and are issued with their weapon. There is a set of closed double doors behind the counter, and it takes Dave seconds to vault the counter, push the doors open, and disappear inside. Some of the lads are quick to get over. By the time I get through the doors, I can hear whistles of appreciation and surprise. The room inside is massive and takes up the rest of the length of the building. There are metal shelves running down both sides, and apart from the first half of one side, they are stacked with guns. The guns look identical and are racked stock down, the trigger guard facing out. The recruits spread out along the end of the room, just looking at the awesome display. Dave is already down at the far end, going through boxes and opening doors to cabinets. I walk down the length of the room, staring at the guns to either side. At the end, I see that Dave has opened a metal cabinet. There are rows of black handles sticking out, and I only realise that they are handguns when Dave pulls one out and slides the top back. The GPMG are gone. Must be out in the field for the exercise, Dave says to me. The what? The general purpose machine gun. They must have taken it out. Is that one of the big things with a tripod or something? Yes. Oh, well, we clearly don't have enough guns here. I glance back along the shelves and stare at the impressive sight. Dave, how long will it take to show us how to use them? Dave pauses and looks back at the recruits and seems to be thinking deeply. Eventually, he turns back to me. To learn how to fire the SA-80 will only take a short time, but they need to know about the moving parts and how to clear the weapon if it jams, and how to clean it. That takes longer to explain, but that only shows them how to use the weapon, and not any basic techniques. OK, mate, well, it's just gone 2pm now, and it gets dark at about 9.30pm, so we need to be in one of those big vehicles by that time, at the very least. How long do you need? Depends on them. Some will pick it up quickly, some won't. I nod and turn to the recruits. I probably know less than they do. But at least they had an interest when they joined up. I've never even seen an army machine gun in real life. I need to learn too. But I also need to be moving and I feel frustrated at the delay. But if Dave can run us through some basic skills now, it will make all the difference when we do have to go back out there, especially if it goes wrong again which it will. It always bloody does. Right, listen up, lads, I shout over to them and they drift down to gather round me. Dave is going to run through basic weapon techniques. We need to learn this if we are going to survive out there. It will be fast learning and we don't have time to keep stopping if you don't keep up. You don't have to do this and it's up to you if you stay or go. They stare back at me. A couple at the back keep turning around to look at the door casting nervous glances at each other. Lads, honestly, you can go if you want to, but your chances of survival are far greater if you learn this. We're going to do it now. They look completely exhausted and ready to drop. I start to feel guilty, as I know I'm pushing them for my own need. There is no way they're going to take this in after what they've been through. You lot look worn out. Do you want to rest for a couple of hours and then go through it? I'm okay, sir. I want to do it now. Blower says to me. Me too, Cook affirms, and then a few more of the hardcore group nod and join in. The quiet ones at the back just stay silent. The two who are glancing at the door are whispering quietly to each other. OK, if you want to do it now, then go over to Dave. I'll be with you in a minute. Apart from the two whisperers, they all go over to Dave. I approach the two, and they look at me sheepishly. Lads, what's up? You keep looking back at the door. They gaze at each other, and then one of them plucks up enough courage to speak. Sir, we just want to go home. We don't live that far away. 
You two know each other then? Not before meeting here. We live in the same area, and we want to go home and see our families. That's fine. You can leave whenever you want. I know you had a nasty time on the planes, but I've seen what it's like out there, and trust me, it isn't pretty. They both stare back at me. They look like children, but then they are, really. Just boys. This is going to sound brutal, but your families might not have survived, or they could be gone from there, thinking you're safe with the army. Make your own decisions, but do so knowing what you're walking into and what to expect. If you want to go, carry on, and I wish you luck, but I really have to get moving. I go back to the group. It's obvious what the two lads are thinking, and the group remain quiet for a minute, chatting to each other in low voices. Sir? I turn round and the two lads have taken a couple of steps towards us. I know they have decided to go, otherwise they would have walked over to us. Okay, lads, that's fine. Stay safe and keep moving. Do everything you can to avoid them and make sure you find somewhere safe at least an hour before nightfall. They both nod and then stand still, unsure of how to say goodbye. If all else fails, head to the forts on the coast. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. Cook walks over and offers his hand to them. They shake and the rest of the recruits go over and also shake hands. Eventually, the two lads break away and leave, closing the door behind them. An uneasy silence follows. Nine left, and a couple of those don't look too confident either. Right, you lot ready? I call over, and they walk back, gathering around Dave. For the next few hours, Dave drilled them relentlessly. First, he handed them a rifle each and made them sit around him. He showed them the basics of how the weapons fire, then how to load and reload the magazine, pull the bolt and make the weapon ready. He showed them the safety switch and how to make the rifle single shot only or fully automatic. Before moving on, he repeated the actions and made them do it together, then individually. He then stripped the weapon down and reassembled it very quickly and then made them do it with him as he stripped his down. Well, I say he made them do it. I was doing it too, but for some reason, Dave didn't make me do it in front of the others, either on the assumption that I would understand or out of the strange respect he seems to hold for me. I kept up, though, and understood the basics within a short time. Dave then ran through the weapon cleaning drills. His way of only saying the bare minimum was highly effective. No confusing jargon or rambling on like most teachers do. Dave was succinct and to the point. His expressionless face also served well, as at no point did he appear to be frustrated or disappointed when they got it wrong and he had to go back to the beginning and start again. Blowers was very proficient, and from the way he handled the weapon, I suspect he must have had previous experience. He assisted with showing the others when they struggled. Dave watched him at first, but didn't say a word. After time, he must have concluded that Blowers knew what he was doing and left him to it. Finally, he made them put the weapon back together, load a magazine and unload it, take the safety off, select single shot, then fully automatic, then remove the magazine and put the safety back on. Dave made each of them do it one by one. Most of them got something wrong with the reassembling, but Blowers went to each of them and talked them through how to do it properly. After watching Blowers for several minutes, curiosity got the better of me and I asked him why he was so proficient. I joined the Royal Marines a couple of years ago, but got kicked out through injury. I was only in a few weeks, but we did loads of weapon drills and some basic manoeuvres. The others seemed to know this already, and didn't pay any attention as he explained it all to me. After doing the rifle drills, Dave had them all gather at the end of the room, and explained that he would show them a very basic fire and manoeuvre method. He got blowers out front with him and spoke quietly to him for a minute. Blowers nodded and stood just behind Dave. Dave then took a few steps forward and dropped to one knee, aimed and dry-fired. He then shouted, Magazine! and started to change his rifle magazine, at which point blowers ran in front of Dave, butt off to the side and also dropped to one knee and started dry-firing. He too shouted, Magazine! and Dave went in front as blowers swapped his magazine over. Dave dropped down and they repeated the actions until they reached the far wall, at which point they both turned and started walking back. The recruits cheered and applauded. 
Blowers looked down and blushed, and Dave just walked back without expression. I must admit, they made it look easy. Dave explained about the danger of having someone in front of you when you have a live weapon, and emphasised the point of moving to the side so you are not directly in front of the man who is changing his magazine behind you. Dave then made them do it with him, one by one, and they took turns to move a few steps, drop down, and fire, then shout, Magazine! as the next one moved forward. Then Dave and Blowers each took a recruit and went through the drill, four of them moving up and down the room. Then they had two recruits each, with two firing and one changing magazines. Finally, Dave told them all to pair off and practice with their chosen partner. Within minutes, the room was a confusing jumble of noise with loud teenage voices bellowing magazine and then cursing when another pair strayed in front of them. How many are coming with us, Mr Howie? Dave asked, after walking over to me. I don't know. Are any of them coming? I reply. Well, it'll be good to know so I can split us into teams ready for when we move. Okay, mate, I'll get their attention and ask them. I shout out for them to come over. Blowers and Cook are working together and don't hear at first until Dave bellows at them. They gather round with red faces, breathing hard from the exertion. Fingers off triggers! Dave shouts in his drill sergeant voice. When at rest, the safety is on and your finger is on the guard, like this. They respond, switching the safety and making a show of holding their fingers over the guards. I glance at Blowers and could see that he had already done it and was resting in the correct manner. Right, lads, I begin. In a short time, Dave and I are going down onto the plains to find something big and nasty that will get us through London. We need to know if any of you want to join us. This is a personal thing. It has nothing to do with any of you, but you are more than welcome and we want to know now if you're coming. They nod back at me, then start whispering to each other. One of the recruits shouts out, Sir, if I come with you, will you drop me off after? Yes, of course. Sir, me and Blowers are in, Cook says, after a short discussion with Blowers. What about your families? I ask them. We don't really have any, sir, to be honest. We haven't really got anything to go back to. OK, if you're sure, it would be great to have you with us. I look to Dave for confirmation and he gives a discreet nod. So, you're going to London and then to the forts, McKinney asks. Yes, mate, I answer. OK, well, I reckon it's safer with you two. You've travelled this far and stayed alive. I'm in until the forts, if that's OK. Of course it is. I look to the rest and see McKinney's words have obviously struck a chord as they go silent and absorb what he just said. Well, they've got this far, haven't they? They must be doing something right. I've got family at home too, but if everyone's going to the forts, then the best chance of seeing them again is going there. McKinney shrugs his shoulders and looks down at his weapon. Five seconds later, and they have all agreed to go. Dave then splits them into two firing teams. The first is Dave... Roland McKinney, Darren Smith, Roy Tucker and Nicholas Hewitt. We are Team Alpha. The rest of you are Team Bravo. And Blowers is the team leader for Bravo. Oh, you wanker. Cook turns to Blowers. I haven't got to take orders from you, have I? Oh, yes, my pretty boy. You will do as you are told, Blowers says in a very camp voice, which says them all off laughing. Dave speaks to me quietly and I nod and go back out to the counter at the front of the building. I find a pen and some paper and go back into the room. Lads, I need to take your names down, just in case something happens and we find your families later. I write down the names that I know. The last three I hadn't learnt before were Alan Brooker, Jamie Reese, and Curtis Graves. The lads then offer me the names of the ones that died on the plains, the one that we lost fighting our way out, and the two that left before we started drilling. Finally, I check my watch. It's almost 5pm. If we leave at 6pm, we will still have three hours of daylight, but I don't know how far it is or where the vehicles will be. Have any of you got any idea where we'll find an APS? APC, Dave and Blowers chorus at me. Bollocks, now there are two of them doing it. Yeah, OK, well, did you see any of them? There was a Saxon near the urban area, Mr Howie. I don't know if it's still there, though, Blowers offers. A Saxon? 
Now, I'm pretty sure I saw a programme on TV about them. Big things with massive wheels, big machine gun on the top. Yes, Dave answers. Right, we go for that then. How far is it to the urban village? I don't know. We were taken by truck. It was quite a long drive. Must be a few miles at least. I was going to give you an hour's rest, but now I'm thinking we should get going. We don't want to be out in the dark with those things running about, especially after what you said you went through on those planes. Do you think you can manage it? I direct my question to the group. They do look exhausted. I feel like a right bastard for making them move again. But this has to be done now. Blowers, Cook and McKinney nod back and call out that they're ready. I get the impression they are making the others go along with it and they all start nodding within a few seconds. Dave then comes over to me and speaks quietly. Mr Howie, we need to find the store's building. They need belts to hold the magazines and some water bottles would be good too. OK, if you say so, mate, I'll give them a chance to rest too. I turn back to the recruits. Right, the plan is that Dave, Blowers and I are going to find the store's building. So you get the chance to practice shooting some zombie motherfuckers while we make a run for it. A few of them look up, excited at the prospect. You each have spare magazines. Do not go forward. Just line up outside and practice single shot only. Aim for the head, Dave instructs them. We head back out to the front and over the counter. I don't know why we didn't use the side door, but I guess this makes it more dramatic. Dave and Blowers each have their assault rifles ready. Mine is strapped to my back and I have my axe. Dave did stare at me when I picked it up. Never leave home without it, I said to him, and he just looked at it again. So you're not taking knives then, I said. He looked sheepish and gave a small smile. Ah, I bloody thought so. We go to the main door and realise that the horde are now all gathered directly at the front, blocking our exit. We end up using the side door and lead the recruits back to the front, coming out just to the side of the horde. Dave tells them to fire from an angle so they don't shoot the buildings. They make ready, but hesitate. Clearly none of them want to be the first to shoot. Dave raises his assault rifle and fires several shots into the crowd, getting headshots with each one. Fuck me, good shot, Cook says. Blowers then fires a few shots, aiming for the head too. Pick your shots and take your time. Dave gives them a final instruction before we move. We leave the recruits and the sounds of individual rifle shots behind us. They're calling to each other and offering encouragement or comments as they hit or miss. We walk out onto the parade square and look back. The recruits are spread out in a row and are firing into the densely packed crowd. The undead zombie soldiers are shuffling and turning around slowly, moving towards the recruits with their slow gait. Every now and then I see a head explode in pink mist as the bullet hits the mark, immediately followed by cheering. Smith runs out of bullets first and shouts, Magazine! loudly. I look at Dave and see him watching them closely. Smith then drops down onto one knee and changes the magazine quickly. He remains on one knee as he continues to fire into the crowd. The rest follow suit, shouting, Magazine! and dropping down to change. We then move off, and Dave identifies the store's building. I have no idea how, as they all look the same to me. Within minutes, we're in a similar structured building, over the counter and into the store's room. What do we need? Blowers asks me and Dave. Belts, magazine holders and water bottles, Dave responds. The room is roughly the same size as the armoury, but there are shelves and units everywhere. There is typical army order here and it doesn't take long to find a big cardboard box to put all of the belts and other things into. Dave also grabs a load of green camouflage jackets and changes the one he is wearing, that is too big, into one that fits better. Blowers comes into view from the end of a unit, holding an army-style long sleeve t-shirt. Are these any good? Might be too hot in these jackets, he asks. Ah, now, that's what we need. Here, Dave, these look handy. I've found a section just for rucksacks. Half of the normal green colour, but the other half are sandy in hue. We fill a couple of the bags with the belts, bottles and ammunition pouches, and more with jackets and t-shirts. Then we put the empty bags into the used ones, so we have less to carry. Fuck it, 
This is silly. Let's just get the lads up here to grab what they need, I say to Dave. I run back outside and over towards the armory building. My jaw drops as I get closer and I see the mound of dead zombies piled and spread out across the front of the building. There are only a handful left now, and the lads are taking their time to aim carefully for the exclusive headshot. I call out and get their attention. As they start running to me, I go back into the stores. Dave, I've got some bad news, mate. What is it, Mr Howie? He stops and stares at me. The lads haven't really left any zombies for you to kill, sorry. They've done them all. Pretty much. The lads come running through, puffing and panting and bragging about how many they dropped. Cook and McKinney are the first through and are breathing hard, clearly having braced the last stretch of ground. We dump all of the kit outside and the lads rummage through to get the right-sized tops and jackets. Dave and Blowers then come out with black and desert-coloured boots in their hands, hanging from their laces. Dave hands me a pair of desert boots, then a pair of tan-coloured heavyweight trousers with pockets on the sides. There's only a few of them, Mr Howie. The rest are normal greens. Thanks, Dave. I join the lads in getting changed into army kit, boots and tops. Most of them change into army trousers too, but the green ones. I note that Dave and Blowers are both in the tan trousers too. A hierarchy is developing already, just in this little group, and I understand that maybe it needs to be done, but I wonder if people will ever change. Dave and Blowers go back into the armory and bring back boxes of ammunition, which they separate and hand out to the recruits. Eventually, I look over to them and see not raw recruits, but soldiers. All of them are chatting, with assault rifles resting across the crooks of their arms, like they saw Dave and Blowers doing. The belts are loaded and the bottles filled from a cold tap inside the store's building. The visual effect is striking, and they suddenly look tougher and harder. Even Tucker looks a bit less soft, but not that much. Mr Howie and I will take point, the rest of you in two lines, evenly spaced out behind us, covering the flanks. Dave gives his instructions. We are a small, untrained group of eleven, headed by a supermarket shelf stacker and a night manager, and we are moving off into the plains towards the undead army. Chapter 14 The infection sweeps through the rats, devastating the rodent population within hours. The infection takes over the small bodies and drives them on, urging them forward to surge out of the sewers and drains and into the streets. The streets and roads are an undulating carpet of sleek black bodies and thousands upon thousands of red bloodshot eyes. Survivors try to flee before they are engulfed by the tidal wave. The rats are given the same clear instruction, bite but don't kill. The rats number in the tens of thousands, and with each being given the same instruction to bite, they soon devastate many potential host bodies. The infection evolves and strives to control this superorganism, to rein them in. Many potential host bodies are so horrifically bitten and injured that even the infection struggled to bring them back. The infection takes greater control and soon the rats are controlled as one, and more and more hosts are found. Hosts that fortified their homes from outside attack, that played the long game and eked out their supplies, were suddenly attacked from within as thousands of wet rats surged from the toilets and drains, overwhelming them within minutes. Small dogs, surviving from the initial outbreak, were in heaven at first as the rats poured into their homes and the plucky, brave little dogs fought with a warrior's courage, killing hundreds of the zombie rodents before finally being brought down. Even then, they fought to the last, proud to be laying their lives down in honour of their owners. The sudden end of mankind and the cessation of the gases and fumes pumped into the atmosphere had an instant effect. The unusually hot summer became scorching, and people that ran and hid in cars and trucks soon found themselves suffering high temperatures, even in the relatively mild climate of northern Europe. But they were too afraid to open their doors against the never-ending wave of rats pouring round and over them. Rats can eat through anything given time, and the infection saw through the rat's eyes and watched the survivors screaming in terror. The infection knows that these small bodies have a very limited lifespan, 
and it will push them faster and harder than any other host, simply to make them work as a superorganism to take over as many larger hosts as possible. A young couple on their way to the forts managed to lock themselves into their car as the rats stormed out into the open. They sat clutching their newborn baby and watched in horrified silence as the rats swept past them, praying they would be spared. The sound of rat claws skittering over the back of the car and then over the top was almost too much to bear. Then the child started whimpering loudly, and the mother panicked and started trying to undo her top, aiming to soothe her baby by breastfeeding. The only noise left now is the swishing of the rats' bodies along the sides of the vehicle. The rats on the front of the car turn and watch the couple through the windscreen, fixing their red, beady eyes onto the frozen parents. The rats start gnawing at the rubber seals of the windows, and before long, there are hundreds of sharp yellow teeth setting to work, slowly eating their way into the car. They are driven by the infection, which can smell the fear of the hosts inside. Chapter 15 We walk at a constant, brisk pace, and I'm sweating freely. The recruits are spread out evenly behind us in two lines, which took some cajoling and berating from blowers at first, but Dave bellowed at the top of his voice and they fell silent, apart from Cook, muttering to blowers behind me, Why'd you get the Gucci brown trousers? Because I'm a section leader, that's why. No, you're a team leader for this today, not for always. It's not promotion in the field. Fuck off, Cookie. You fuck off, blowers, with your super brown trousers. Ha, go and iron your nice green BDUs, mate. You're a cock, blowers. Sorry, what'd you say, Cookie? Did you say you like cock? You know what I said. You said that you like cock. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a modern world. Get fucked. I didn't say anything like that. Yes, you did. You said that you like cock. You like zombie cock. Blowers, you wanker. I'm going to have a negligent discharge in a minute and shoot you. Blowers bursts out laughing. A negligent discharge? What, in your pants? Have you seen a hot zombie or something then? You fucking twat. Watch out, lads. Cookie is going to bum some zombies. Everyone starts laughing at Cook, who yells abuse at them all for a few minutes, then joins in with the laughing. I walk on, smiling at the easy banter behind me. Don't they call this tabbing or something? I asked Dave. Yes, Mr Howie. Why not just walking? The Romans did it first. A soldier has to show he can march to a place with weight that's called a loaded march. The word tab comes from tactical advance to battle. Oh. I fall silent for a moment. Dave, did you enjoy showing those recruits what to do? Enjoy? I don't understand, Mr Howie. Well, you were good at it. Did you ever teach when you were in the army? No, not really. Well, there were times when I had to tell units what to do so we could achieve our objective, but that's it. What about that voice? You sound like a proper drill sergeant. When they knew I could shout loudly, they taught me what to say to the enemy to make them scared. Scared men make mistakes. Bloody hell. I think I had better start calling you Mr. Dave from now on. No, Mr. Howie. Dave suddenly spoke in a very serious tone. I was joking, Dave, but mate... I don't know any more than they do, and I know less than blowers. I guess I don't feel right taking the position of leader. Dave goes from constant scanning of the area to looking at me. I can show them how to shoot and strip weapons and kill those things, but I don't understand people. I don't see the difference in any of them. I don't understand characters and personalities or when people are upset. I just don't get that kind of thing. People are just people, Dave. Insecure and scared like the rest of us. People are easy to understand, really. Not to me. Well, people have base needs, like needing to eat and drink. Take any of those needs away and people die very easily. But then you have base emotions, too. Things like love, hate, greed, lust and jealousy. They're incredibly powerful emotions that drive people to do the most amazing things. And if you mix a few of them together with other, maybe less impacting emotions like insecurity or distress, then you can have issues. Real issues. If you look at history and the evil dictators, I bet all of them had a mixture of those issues going on. Plus, when you couple that with the immediate family around you, then the people, society and community you grow up in, and the cultural beliefs that are drummed into people when they're young, 
well, it can make for a deadly recipe. Fascinating, but deadly. Look at this around us now. Something like this could have been caused by an evil tyrant addicted to power, or a belief that his god is the right one, so everyone else must suffer and die. Or it could just as easily be a scientist working in a lab somewhere, safe and secure and the most rational person you could ever meet. One day he gets home to find his wife is cheating and he's consumed with anger and jealousy and bang, he takes the whole world out for one seemingly small act that would otherwise be a private episode in someone's life. In fact, I've heard theories that Adolf Hitler grew up surrounded by wealthy Jews when his family was relatively poor, and so maybe that sparked his intense hatred. A chemical imbalance that sits dormant and then explodes from one random act? Then there is the old cliché of power corrupts. We only have to look at every government that has ever come to power to know that exists. And then, of course, there is communism. What a fantastic notion that everything should be owned by everyone and shared equally. But at a certain point, there will be some bugger stood there thinking he's doing more work than others, so therefore he's entitled to more than they have. He gets a bit more, and then he always wants more. And if they don't give it to him, he will take it. That's why revolutions never really work. You can take a whole bunch of people that have conflicting beliefs, but they unite against a common enemy and work together to bring that enemy down. Say, the ruling government. But that just leaves a void, and someone has to fill that void. Someone has to work out the tax rate, fix the roads, and make sure that the hospitals are working. And then, of course, we have security and food to eat. And with the best will in the world, you take a bunch of people and put them in a room together to work out the best for everyone, and they'll spend most of the time bickering and arguing. Someone will come out on top, and you're back to the saying of power corrupts again. Then the others get resentful and jealous, and it never really ends. Hence the name Revolution. It's gone very quiet around me, and I look back to see all of the recruits staring at me with interest. That's why you're in charge, Mr Howie, Dave says, simply. Two hours later, and we're deep into the rolling plains. The roadway leads directly through the plains, as far as I can tell. To both sides, there is just wide-sweeping, gently rolling hills. The land is very dry from the scorching summer, and I can see deep track marks from the tanks and heavy vehicles all around us. It must have been hell trying to cross this land, especially in the dark, and I find a new respect for the recruits. I can't imagine most regular troops being able to do that, but then they are young and learn from hard living in hard times. We've only stopped once for a rest, and that was called by me when I glanced back and saw the exhaustion on their faces. We took ten minutes to drink the water and eat high-energy snack bars that were purloined from a box that Tucker found in the stores building. He must have sneaked them into his backpack when everyone else was putting boots on and making sure they looked like commandos. When he broke them out and handed them round, he was a hero for five minutes, and I could see him grinning with the respect they gave him. After the ten minutes, we were back on, and not one of them moaned. They've hardly slept or taken on decent food since Friday, and they're still going. Grim determination and a fear of being left alone is driving them on. Eyes on! Dave calls from my side. I snap out of my reverie and look up. Ahead of us, the road sweeps round to the right, and we can just make out the top of a church spire. The atmosphere charges instantly, and I can feel the recruits tensing up and watching left and right as we make our way forward. There is a low embankment to both sides, and I wave the recruits into the right side to take cover. Rest for a minute, but stay sharp, Dave tells them as we shrug off our backpacks and start belly crawling out to the middle of the road, and then slowly forward, until the bend opens up and we can see down into the village. There are houses on both sides of the village, old brick-built things that have seen far better days, but have clearly been patched up here and there to keep them usable for training. The road goes down to a crossroads, and there is a big church on the right. There is a makeshift area, encased by a circle of sandbags, just before the village and on the right side. I guess this must be the safe area the recruits were sent to when they were captured. The plains roll out far on both sides of the village. It looks like there was once a thicket of vegetation off to the left side, but it's been cut down to open the area up. 
From our position, we can just make out the edge of another circular sandbag area, situated in the corner between the rows of houses ahead of us and the houses on the road to the right of us. That's a fucking lot of zombies, I say to Dave as I look in awe at the largest gathering of undead I have seen yet. The exercise must have been immense, as there are zombie soldiers packed into the village centre. From the start of the building line and down past the crossroads, there are zombie soldiers shuffling and rolling their heads. The distance is too great to see detail, but I can imagine the drooling mouths and the red bloodshot eyes, their horrific injuries drying and festering in the high heat, and swarms of flies and insects buzzing in amongst them. The heat coming from them must be intense, as there is a haze just above them. Oh yes, that's a lot of fucking zombies, I repeat to myself in shock at the sight. Dave stays silent, assessing the area in front of us. Fuck the guns, mate, let's just go for it with the axe and the knives, I say to Dave. He turns to me and gives a small smile. I'm joking, you fucking psycho, although it would be bloody good fun. See in the middle of the crossroads? Dave points and I follow the straight line he is pointing out and just make out the top of something slap bang in the middle of the intersection. What's that? I ask Dave. The Saxon. Shit. It's completely surrounded. How the fuck are we going to get to that? It'll be dark before we even get close to leading them away and we really don't want to be out here when that lot turn all werewolf on us. A shiver runs down my spine at the thought of the noise they make. We snake our way over to the group who are huddled into the side of the road. How is it? Cook whispers as soon as we get close enough. Bad. Very bad. There must be well over a thousand of them. What the hell are so many soldiers doing here? Nobody answers, and even Dave just shakes his head. Is it normal for so many soldiers to be in one place like this for a training exercise? I ask again. Sometimes, but it's quite rare... It takes some logistics to get regiments and units into one place, Dave answers, but he doesn't sound convincing. I nod back at him, then glance around the recruits. The APC is in the middle of the crossroads. There might be more than one of them, but after what you've told me about the size of the planes, we would be safer if we just try to get this one. Agreed? They nod back at me. Right, so me and Dave have previously used the lead them away tactic, which would be perfect if we had time, but a group that size would take hours to move away, especially when they're slow like now. On the other hand, we don't want to be anywhere near them when it gets dark. Agreed? More nods. So we have to attack them. The disadvantages are that they're stacked very deep around that APC and it's getting late. The advantages are stacked in our favour though. They're slow moving and packed together, and we have machine guns and lots of ammunition. I look to Dave. Do we have enough ammunition for a crowd that size? I'm not sure. We bought spare magazines, but they don't die unless they're headshots or the body is so severely injured that they cannot physically move. Bollocks, I wish we had one of those big machine guns. What did you call it? A GPMG? Yes. We could really do with one right now. Sir. There was one being used, Blowers cuts in. It was on the corner of the crossroads. What? Um, it was behind a load of sandbags. Yeah, I saw the edge of the sandbags. Are you sure that was it, though? Sir, the sound is unmistakable. Dave, is that right? Yes, the sound is unique, especially if Blowers heard them before, when he did his Royal Marines training, Dave answers. Did you hear one before, Blowers? I ask him. Yeah, bloody loads of times, he says, excited. Ah, fucking hang on, do they use real bullets during these exercises, Dave? No, Mr Howie, only very few exercises use live rounds. The GPMG won't be loaded now. Will there be real bullets near it that we can use? No, back in the armoury, Dave says. Bollocks. Right, that's fucked then. Unless there's a vehicle round here we can use to send someone back quickly, other than the Saxon thing, that is. Lads, did any of you see another vehicle anywhere? Lots of shaking heads. No, sir, it was dark. We are in the houses all the time, McKinney says. Then I see one of the quiet lads looking at me thoughtfully. Go on, mate. 
Curtis, is it? Yes, sir. Curtis Graves, he answers softly. OK, Curtis. Did you see one? Er, uh, there was a Land Rover just down from the crossroad, sir. My dad had one, and I recognised it. Great. Nice one, Curtis. That's brilliant. Now, where did you last see it? Off that way. Graves waves towards the village and over to the left. OK, mate. So, on the left side of the village as we look at it from this road here. Yep. Uh, I mean, yes, sir. Come with me, mate, I say to Graves, and we both belly shuffle out into the middle of the road. Fucking hell, Graves says when he sees the almighty undead horde. Yeah, I know, right? Oh well, fuck em, we'll get through them somehow. Now try to describe exactly where you saw it last. A sudden noise and groaning comes from behind us, and we look around to see an undead sliding down the embankment directly into the recruits. They burst away, and Dave immediately dives in and starts striking the head with the butt of his rifle. Some of the other lads join in, and the zombie groans as he's pummeled by several rifle butts at the same time. Dave then whips out one of his knives and slices it across the throat of the zombie soldier. A spray of crimson starts spurting out, and Dave rolls the undead over so the blood goes into the ground. Once he's done, he looks back at me and gives a thumbs up. Fuck me, Dave, can't you go more than five minutes? I whisper over to him. He just shrugs and gives a small smile. Now, Curtis, sorry mate, where was it? That's all right, sir. It was to the left of the crossroads and down a bit, he indicates with a wave of his arm. OK, let's get back. We belly shuffle back to the group and I shake my head reproachfully at Dave as I look at the undead lying in a pool of blood. Dave, I think you and I should go for the Land Rover. The rest of you stay put. OK, Mr Howie. Dave nods and starts getting ready. Blowers, you're in charge until we get back. If you hear us firing, then start shooting those fuckers and move slowly back up the road, OK? Yes, sir. Blowers grins and nudges Cook. Hear that, Cookie? You can start bumming them till we hear shooting. Fuck off, Blowers! Cook grins back at him. Dave puts his rifle on his back and takes his two straight-bladed knives in his hands. I reluctantly leave my beloved axe and just take the rifle. Tucker, look after my axe, mate. Please don't lose it, I tell him as I prepare to go. Yes, sir! Tucker swells with pride and clutches the axe protectively with both hands. Ready, Dave? Yes, Mr Howie. We move off, keeping low. We cross the road and get over the embankment, then down the other side. We move at a fast pace, but bent over and aim far left, behind the rows of houses. We quickly pass the sandbag safe area, then move further left so we are well away from the road. Up close, I can see the houses are not really well maintained at all, and none of them have glass in the windows, just empty holes with shutters held open. The garden fences to the rear gardens have been relatively well kept, and I guess this adds realism to the place. Within minutes, we are past the houses and nearing the road, coming into the crossroads from the left. The undead are still densely packed, and we have to go quite far down the row of houses before we see a sufficient gap. We get to the back of one of the properties and start inching forward until we can lean out and peek down the road. The Land Rover is parked to the side of the road furthest away from us, there are zombie soldiers shuffling and groaning near it, but the gaps between them look fairly decent. I reckon we can make that day if you're up for it. Yes. We dart out and start sprinting down and across the road, dodging round zombie soldiers who immediately turn and start moving towards us. The rancid stench of rotting meat is disgusting, and I can see their skin already looks to be decomposing. I don't engage the zombies this time, but stick with dodging around and through them until I reach the vehicle. Dave, on the other hand, can't help himself and has already slit a few throats by the time we get to the car. We clamber into the front, and I thank God as I see the key still in the ignition. The diesel engine splutters loudly, and apart from the low groans of the undead, the area was quite silent. The noise immediately gets a reaction, and more of them start moving towards us. I turn the wheel hard, surprised at how much force is needed. I realise these vehicles don't have power-assisted steering. I have to roll forward and then back a few times until I'm facing the other way, knocking over a few zombies in the process. 
Once we're turned around, I drive off and keep going down the road until the row of houses ends. Then I turn left and drive onto the plains and head back towards the area we left the recruits. Well, mate, I think they know we're here now, I say to Dave, who just nods back at me. I drive around the backs of the houses, then past the sandbag safe area and onto the road. The recruits must have heard the engine and are moving out into the middle of the road as we come around the corner. I stop the vehicle, but leave the engine running and jump out. Curtis, can you drive, mate? Did you ever drive your dad's Land Rover? Yeah, loads of times, he replies and starts moving over to me. Right, you and Dave get back to the armory and get the ammunition for that GMPG. GPMG, Dave calls out. Yeah, that thing. You and Dave get the ammo. We'll start shooting the fuckers from here. Got it? Yes, sir. Graves gets into the driver's seat as I yell one last instruction at him. Curtis, we won't be able to hold them for long, so be quick. The Land Rover roars off, leaving me with the recruits. Well, lads, they know we're here. I reckon we should spread out in a line and start shooting them. You up for it? Sir, can I put one on top of each embankment to watch the flanks and the rear? Blowers asks. Good thinking, mate. Yeah, do that. Cookie, you take the right flank. Smith, you take the left flank. Keep a good lookout and make sure you keep checking behind us. Blowers gives a clear instruction and they both start scrambling up. The horde are all facing our way now and look immense, even from this distance. The army uniform seems to amplify their numbers and make them look even more sinister. Fuck it, some of them still have their NATO helmets on, Smith shouts down from the top of the embankment. Well, there ain't much we can do about that, is there? I respond. Apart from shooting them in the knees? A few of the lads snigger and I can sense the nervous excitement. I move out to the centre of the road and drop my bag down at my side, then the axe that I retrieved from Tucker. I open the top and make sure there are spare magazines at hand. The lads start spreading to both sides until we're evenly spaced across the width of the road. Lads, pick your shots and try to make each one count, Blowers calls out. I ready my rifle, raise it up to my shoulder and look down the sights on the barrel. The horde is still some distance away and headshots will be bloody impossible from here. But from previous experience, I know we will slow them down if we drop the ones at the front and create an obstacle to those behind. I call out my instructions and then lower my sights a little, until I'm aiming into the hundreds of pairs of legs shuffling towards us. I fire first, and instantly see a zombie soldier get spun back into the few behind him. He goes down, and the next one trips over him. Just like that, I call out to a few cheers. The shots start ringing out, and I watch as zombies are dropped and fall to the ground. Most of them carry on moving but soon we have created a natural obstacle for the horde. However, the sheer press of bodies from behind just surges them forward, over their fallen zombie comrades. We press on, and I can hear a clear gap between shots as the lads try hard to pick their shots. We work in silence, and many zombie soldiers are shot down. As they get closer, we can pick out individual details and see the horrific injuries they have already sustained. I raise my aim and start trying to shoot in the general head area. I know that if I miss the one I'm aiming for, I will most likely still get one or two behind it. Magazine! I yell out as I start changing the ammunition for my assault rifle, doing as Dave showed us all. I take a quick glance about and look at the grim faces of the young recruits, concentrating and firing their weapons. Cookie and Smith are up top and also firing away down into the horde. Cookie! Smith! Keep checking the sides and the rear, I call out to them, trying to make myself heard over the gunshots. I see them respond, and both stop firing to look off into the planes and check behind them. I reload, take aim, and start firing again. The horde are incessant, and despite the large numbers we're dropping, they just keep coming at us. I'm concerned at how close they are, remembering the super zombie, and suddenly become very wary in case they start charging at us. Move back, lads! Move back! I shout and hear blowers repeating my words further down the line. We all stop firing and start shuffling backwards, either carrying or dragging our kit bags with us. We have to stop as we reach the apex of the bend in the road, otherwise we wouldn't get a good view of them. 
Within a few seconds, we're all back to firing and dropping more and more zombies. I can see the effects of the shots now, and watch as heads burst apart and pink matter sprays up. Torso shots hit home, fresh blood pumps out onto their clothing. The heads of the zombies are rolling and their gait is still awkward and stiff-legged. I watch them closely for any sign of normality, but they are too densely packed to see beyond the first couple of rows. Again, after a few minutes, we're forced to move back again. But the bend in the road means we won't get a clear view if we move back any further. Up on the banks, I shout out. There is confusion as they all start moving towards the same bank. Team Alpha on the left and Bravo on the right, I shout again, and they run towards the appropriate side and clamber up. I go right and climb up too. The small height difference means we can shoot down into them and probably will get better headshots. The undead army are spilling out, away from the road on both sides. I look down the road and my heart sinks as I see they are still stacked right back past the crossroads. I bloody hope Dave hurries up. We keep firing and every so often we have to move back. It doesn't take long before they're on the stretch of road between the banks and also out onto the sides. We're forced to move back further and further up the road, and despite inflicting massive casualties, they don't show any sign of stopping. The light is starting to fade, and I can see that my ammunition is getting very low. There are several magazines left in the bag, but at this rate they won't last long, and I start to feel very concerned that we'll be trapped in the darkness with low or depleted ammunition. Lads, we're going to run out into the plains to the right side. Follow me. I hear blowers, then Cookie repeat the order, and the lads gather their kit, shrugging on bags and moving towards me. We start moving away from the road and out to the right side, onto the plains. We make distance for a few seconds, and then stop for a rest. It's going to be dark soon, and we absolutely cannot be out here when that happens. Dave and Curtis should be back soon, but we have to make a plan to get somewhere safe. I reckon we should make for that church. We go far right and loop round until we come at it from the far side. What do you think? Sounds good, sir, Blowers responds, and several of them nod at me. OK, let's get moving. We move out, further into the plains, and our fast pace soon leaves the horde behind, but they've already turned in our direction en masse. We keep going out, and before long, we cross over the road and go back onto the plains on the other side. The sky darkens with each second we're running, and I can feel the fear building up within us all. We then turn back towards the village and the general direction of the church. Within minutes, it comes into view. Looks clear from here, I say through ragged breath, more to try and lift their spirits than anything else. Then we get closer and see some of the horde are coming our way from the direction of the village crossroads, spilling out through the buildings which are well in view now. We slow down and stop for a few seconds, breathing hard. If we go into the plains, we will get separated from Dave and Curtis. I look to each man in turn. We're going to have to fight our way through. There's no other choice. The church is the biggest and strongest building. Are you ready? They nod back, silent but determined. That drill that Dave showed you, we can use that as we get closer. When I say... I want Team Bravo to stop and Team Alpha to move forward a short distance and fire. I'll go with Alpha, blowers with Bravo. When we finish firing and shout magazine, that's when Bravo moves forward. Got it? They nod back and start shuffling so that McKinney, Smith, Tucker and Hewitt are forward with me. Blowers pulls the rest back a few steps. OK, let's go. We start moving forward again, and I see my team start to spread out a little, just as Dave showed them. Within a very short time, we're very close, and I can see there are a few undead already between us and the church, but more are shuffling out between the sides of the buildings. As we get to within 50 metres of the first load of undead, I shout the order. Alpha, stop! We all stop and kneel down. Fire! I yell, and start firing single shots at the zombie soldiers. They drop down as several of us shoot the same ones, but that can't be helped, and we keep firing and dropping them. Magazine! Smith yells first and starts to change. Within seconds, we have all shouted the magic word, and I wave my arm forward for blowers. Bravo on me! Blowers yells, and they surge past us, until he shouts to stop, and they kneel down and start firing again. 
I take the opportunity to get some deep breaths to try and slow my breathing down. Magazine! Bravo starts yelling, and I watch until Blowers waves his arm forward. Alpha on me! We spring up and charge forward and go past the kneeling Bravo team. I take them about 40 metres ahead and shout to stop. We assume the position and commence firing again. We focus on the undead zombies between us and the church, and we still keep dropping many of them, but more are still coming through the gaps towards us. Magazine! I yell out and glance to the sky. It's very dark now, and it can only be a matter of minutes before the night is on us properly. I wait until they have all shouted and wave my arm forward. For the next few minutes, we advance slowly towards the church, and the bodies are piling up around and in front of us. As my team change magazines, I yell out, In a minute, they will all stop and look up. When that happens, just fucking leg it to the church. Team Bravo runs through us and commences firing. As they start shouting, Magazine! The already massed horde coming through the building gaps all suddenly stop and stand still, raising their heads slowly to look up into the sky. Now! Fucking run! I bellow and start running towards the church. There is no order now and we are all sprinting towards the building which is still a couple of hundred metres away. The distance is short but the ground is uneven and we are all exhausted. Our speed ebbs away. We hear the sudden roars and howling of the undead as they scream out to one another. The massive numbers means the sound is incredible and it serves to drive us on faster. Keep going! Don't stop! I urge them on. The fucking axe is banging against my legs again, having been wedged down between my back and the bag. I reach the church building and kick open the large wooden side door. The next one behind me is Cook. Cookie, check that the other doors are closed. He runs inside and McKinney joins him. I look back and see most of them are almost at the door, apart from Tucker. He is running, but I can see he is exhausted and looks like he will collapse. Run, Tucker! I yell out, and the others join in, urging him to run faster. The howling suddenly stops, and I see the zombie heads drop down and turn to face us, switched on now, focused and mean. Covering fire! Blowers yells out, and we drop down onto our knees and start firing into the zombies. As the first shots hit home, they react and are running towards us. We keep firing as they gain on Tucker, picking our shots carefully and aiming for centre mass. Several of them are right behind him as he takes the last few steps into the church. Inside now! I shout, and we all bundle inside, slamming the door just as Tucker bursts in. We brace the door and several of them push their weight against it as the undead bodies slam into it from the other side. Grab that locking bar! I shout at Jamie Reese, indicating a thick piece of wood resting against the wall. We slot the bar down into the metal hooks and slowly ease our weight off. The bar holds and we can hear the bodies slam into the door from the other side. The other door is secure, says Cookie as he comes back and flops down, breathing hard. I move into the centre of the room. Just a few rows of wooden pews remain. Everything else has been cleared away. Even the stained glass windows are gone, but the gaps are just over head height and the zombies shouldn't be able to get through unless they've suddenly learnt to start climbing. I remember the super zombie again. Right, I want two covering each door in case they break through. The rest of you pull the pews over to the windows and start shooting down into them, but save some ammunition in case they get through the doors. I check each door. They're solid wood, but old, and they can't take too much of a battering. If we get large numbers of undead bodies pressing against them, they could go through. The lads pull pews over and climb up. I can hear shots as they shoot down. I go to both sides and look out. The view from the front is very worrying, and the groans and noises from the undead are a lot louder now. We all fire down, but they just keep coming, and soon we are each down to our last magazine. Everyone in the middle, pull the pews around us. We form a low and flimsy barricade with a pew just inside each door and a few around us. Then we all stand in the middle, half facing one door, half facing the other. My axe is next to me, ready to be picked up and used when the bullets run out. Where the fuck is Dave? We stand in silence, jumping and twitching at the bumps and bangs coming from the doors. 
The front door starts to make a creaking noise, and we all turn to stare at it. A definite sound of wood creaking, and then a splintering noise. Each of us raises our rifles to our shoulders and aims directly at the door. This is it, lads. Get ready, I say in a surprisingly strong voice. The wood splinters louder and the door starts to break inwards as a horde of undead zombie soldiers pile more and more body weight into it. Just as the door seems that it will implode, a sudden fast and loud thudding sounds out and blows immediately cheers. That's the fucking GPMG, he screams out. We push the pews away and drag them over to the window at the front. Once up, I look out and see a bright flashing light coming from the corner of the crossroads. It's too bright to see beyond the light, but I know that Dave is standing there, probably smiling to himself as he slaughters thousands of zombies. The effect is amazing, and we watch bodies being shredded and ripped apart from the large calibre rounds. We are all cheering and whooping and watch as the zombies come around from behind the church and start running towards the noise and are instantly mown down by hails of bullets. A second gun rings out, and I realise that Curtis must be with Dave, watching the flanks and rear. Lights suddenly come on from the Land Rover that is parked behind the sandbags. The vehicle is facing the crossroads, and I can see Dave illuminated as he rests the front tripod on the edge of the sandbags and fires into the crossroads, shredding everything in his path. It goes quiet for a second. Then... Fight your way to the rear! We've got loads of ammo! Right, lads! We go out the back and move together as one, I shout out, and we scoop our bags and kit up and go over to the rear wooden doors. I stop to listen and press my ear against the door, but I can't hear anything. Cookie, me and you get ready to shoot out, Blowers says, as he and Cookie drop down a few steps back from the doors. I lift the locking bar up, and me and Nicholas Hewitt take a door each. We wrench it open and stand back, but neither Cookie or Blowers starts firing. Looks clear, sir, Blowers calls out. Let's go, I shout, and we surge out. The area is clear, apart from the bodies of the zombies we shot earlier. We move around and start making our way towards the Land Rover, reaching it within seconds. Bravo, take the sides in the rear, Alpha at the front, I call out, and we push into the circular area of the sandbags and start firing out into the crossroads. The noise from the GPMG is deafening this close. Fucking good to see you again, mate, I yell at Dave. You too. Sorry about the wait. Soon, it's all over, and there are scores of bodies scattered about the area and shiny spent casings littering the ground. We move out slowly, finishing off the ones that are writhing on the ground, shooting directly into their heads from close range. That was fucking tense, Blowers says to Cookie. Fucking telling me, mate. Jesus, I thought we were fucking done for. Oi, Tucker, you need to start running faster, mate. They almost had you back then, Cookie shouts out. I'm not built for running, Tucker yells back. Built for fucking eating is what you are, one of them shouts. I work with Dave at the back of the Land Rover, filling the lads' backpacks with more magazines. A few of the recruits have been posted as sentries and are standing looking out into the plains with their rifles at the ready. So what took you so long? I ask Dave. It was a long drive and we had to load up then get back, he answers. Ah, uh, we had them just where we wanted them, I say to him. He stops packing and looks up at me and nods. Okay, Mr Howie. The APC is loaded and ready. The controls look just like a normal vehicle. I'm sure I'll be able to figure it out as I go. Thankfully, there's no key needed, and the engine roars to life at the press of a switch. There is another GPMG on the top, which Dave has already loaded with a belt of shiny big bullets. The rear section is massive, with seats going down each side. Within a short time, the recruits all pile in. Dave quickly runs through how to fire and reload the GPMG and tells them that someone must be up there at all times. As Dave gets into the front with me, I hear them all start bickering about who is going to be first. The Saxon vehicle is massive and feels solid and strong. It has taken a huge effort to get it, but I'm glad we did. If this won't get through London, then I don't know what will. A tank, maybe? But we've already discussed that. Can we stop at the armory again and get more supplies, Mr Howie? 
Yeah, no problem, mate. I reckon we should park up somewhere and get some sleep first. I know that lot must be ready to drop. Best go into the plains then. Find somewhere quiet, Dave says. Okay, mate. Sounds good. I pull away with a hard jerk and bounce along for a distance, getting shouts and jeers from the back until I get a smoother motion. We head out into the plains and drive for a solid ten minutes, keeping a rough line with the road way off to the right. Eventually I stop and shut the engine down. Dave climbs into the back and relieves blowers on the GPMG and tells them all to get some sleep. Within minutes, they're all gone, and I look down at the filthy, drawn, young faces and I feel immensely proud to have worked alongside them. Young, jobless, and sent here to get experience, and now look at them. They're a unit, a fighting unit. I think ahead to the next day and moving towards London. I'm willing my sister to just sit and wait and know that I'm coming for her. I try to think through everything that's happened today, but I feel very sleepy and my eyes are drooping. Tomorrow we shall go to London. I just bloody know something else will happen though. It always does. Chapter 16 The infection has overwhelmed the rodent population and drives them on during the night, biting and clawing at everything in their path. A young undead couple stands by the side of a car that has been eaten into by hundreds of sharp yellow teeth, and an undead zombie baby groans on the seat, red bloodshot eyes staring up at the sky. The infection knows these small rodent hosts cannot sustain this pace for long, but they can take so many more hosts. The infection also knows how long these hosts will last. 24 hours. Day 5. Tuesday morning. Chapter 17. From an empty window frame of an old cottage in the urban training zone, the infection watched as many hosts were torn down. It saw the humans coming and sent the horde after them, but the daylight meant that it was slow and weak and couldn't respond fast enough. The infection feels each loss of each host and knows it is being diminished and reduced. It doesn't know how or why it came into existence, only that it is, and the primary function is to survive. And if it must survive, then these losses must be stopped. The infection recognises the humans that cause these problems. All over the world, the infection watches these humans fight back and inflict losses on its invaluable hosts. And it knows that it must stop this from happening. It must end the losses. In order to do this, it must evolve and learn how to fight back. The infection spread so rapidly that it knew it would only be a matter of a short time before it ruled this place and all in it. But it did not expect the ingenuity or bravery of these few humans. The masses were taken over within hours, but some were quick and fought back or hid. The infection did not concern itself at first, knowing that the numbers it possessed would lead it to take them all. But now it senses there is a desperation to the situation. These humans are inflicting too many losses, and this must be stopped. These potential hosts offering resistance are cunning, and they use more than their bodies. They have tools and coordination. The infected host body stands still and watches as the recruits cut down the hosts. The brain inside the host is given more energy, and synapses start flowing. The infection uses the intelligence and the memories stored in this mind but it doesn't understand these memories or thought processes, so it releases more energy and then feels as the host starts to take back control. The infection knows it can stop this at any time, so allows the host to exert that control. The infected body stares forward and then moves its eyes from left to right. The hands start clenching and unclenching, and the rate of breathing increases. The energy flow is enhanced and control is given back to the host body, which falls to its knees, screaming in agony, clutching its head at the intense pain surging from every cell. The body becomes demented and is raving in lunacy, staggering into walls and falling over furniture. The infection takes control and sends more energy into the nerve endings, and the body screams with pain and drops to the floor, writhing in agony. The infection sends more signals to the pain receptors and the host goes taut, the agony too much to bear. 
The body would normally shut down and slip into unconsciousness at this point, but the infection doesn't allow that. It keeps the body awake and learns as the electrical impulses are fired throughout the body. The mind has been given back, but the pain is so intense the host body stays rigid, hardly breathing. Every vein sticks out and the muscles are tense and tight. Even death isn't an option now. Death has happened once to this man, and the infection will not allow that mercy now. Slowly pulling back the flow of energy to the nerve ending and pain receptors, the infection diverts the energy to the parts of the brain that release endorphins and the pleasure receptors. The body slowly relaxes and the muscles release. The body twitches sporadically from the intense contractions of the muscles. The body starts to smile and moan softly as it is flooded with chemicals, giving it an amazing feeling of warmth and security. Then, as the pleasure heightens, there is a natural reaction from the body, and before long, its erection is straining against its trousers. The infection releases a surge of endorphins, and the body once again goes taut, and the muscles contract, as the feeling is too strong to bear. The infection eases the flow and draws back the control piece by piece, testing and learning as each function is given some power, then drawing it back to test other reactions. The body writhes in ecstasy, then eases back into a normal state. Then the body sits up and the knees bend to allow it to stand, but this is slow and cumbersome. The body puts its hands down to the floor and uses them to brace the weight as the body's feet to find the balance needed. The body slowly rises up into a standing position, then extends the arms out straight, then above the head. It bends the arms at the elbows and flexes them back out. It spins the arms round in circles, first forward and then backwards. The body jumps on the spot, heavy and unwieldy. Then another jump and the infection learns to control the flex of the tendons in the feet and toes to find balance. The body continues to jump and move about the room, the arms spinning and waving. It kneels down and jumps up, then takes small leaps forward and backwards. All across the world, various infected bodies go through the same moves, spinning and jumping. A release of energy to the nerve endings and all the bodies fall to the floor in agony. Endorphins are quickly released and the bodies stand up, drunkenly. In New York, Paris, Barcelona, Delhi, Singapore and towns and cities all over the globe, the bodies work in the same pattern, leaping, running on the spot, dancing and weaving as the infection fights to control the electrical impulses, watching through hundreds of host bodies' eyes, seeing different scenes but sharing the common feeling, while hundreds of thousands of host bodies across the world are cut down and slain by the brave people fighting back. The infection learns to control these few bodies. While Howie and the recruits fought with grim determination, moving back a step at a time, the infected hosts were slaughtered, too slow and cumbersome, shambling and shuffling as the bullets ripped them apart. Then, as night fell, the infection released the power that it had built up. It made the host bodies roar into the night so they could find one another and send fear driving into the hearts of the humans. The infected watched them run and hide and sent more hosts after them. The infection felt the church door starting to yield and knew it would be over within seconds. The smell of fear coming from inside was strong, but not as strong as it expected. Then it was over, and the hosts were torn apart and shredded by one man using a tool, and then the humans were together again, and it was done. The infection took the losses and learnt from them and watched from the upstairs window of the house in the urban training zone. It heard the men laugh and call to each other. It watched the man in the centre of the others be shown respect and deference. It heard the humans speak, and the same word is repeated again and again. The infected body stands still now and stares out into the night. It watches as the sun rises and can feel its body slowing down to recover and repair. The infection sends energy to the chest, makes air come out of the mouth and moves the vocal cords to make sounds such as it does when the darkness comes. This time the noise is subtle and quiet. The body keeps practicing, making noises until it hears the word that sounds the same as the humans. It repeats this word over and over again, drawing the sound out until it resonates and becomes fluid. It is one word. Howie. Chapter 18
Through the night, the recruits sleep in the rear of the Saxon armoured personnel carrier that is painted in the greys and blacks of urban camouflage. Although exhausted to the point of near collapse, they still cleaned their weapons and made them ready before they slept. The sleeping bodies in the hot metal vehicle soon built up a high heat in the already warm and muggy night. Dave had insisted that a lookout should be posted on the general purpose machine gun at the top of the Saxon, and before long, recruits were falling out of the rear doors and sleeping directly on the ground underneath the vehicle, just to escape the heat. Howie slept in the front and had woken midway through the night to find Jamie Reese on lookout duty. He could see that Reese was wilting and fighting sleep, so Howie relieved him and took over the GPMG. Howie felt the heat in the vehicle as he climbed into the rear to go up through the sentry hole, and he opened the doors to let some air in. He roused some of the sleeping men and told them to sleep outside. The recruits were sweating profusely, but were so exhausted they just slept on until he poked and prodded them and half dragged them out into the cooler air, fearing they would become dehydrated. Dave roused and saw what was happening. He nodded to Howie to show he understood, and then climbed out of the front cabin and onto the top of the vehicle, and lay down on his back, asleep within seconds. Howie watched from the sentry point, turning around slowly and making use of a high-powered light that was connected by a lead to a power supply within the Saxon. As he watched, he thought of his mother and father and the sacrifice they must have made trying to come for him. He had no evidence of their demise, and his greatest fear was that he would see them as zombies and either have to destroy them or be eaten by them. They might still be alive, but how he knew this was very unlikely. The only family he had left was his sister, Sarah, living in London. Howie's parents had left him a note, saying that they had spoken to Sarah and she was safe in her apartment. The last four days had been spent trying to get to London to rescue Sarah. His hometown was gone, and so were all the other places he had seen so far. A message he had heard from a radio broadcaster told any survivors to head for the forts on the south coast, and to stay away from London. He'd known that getting through London would be impossible without some serious assistance, so he and Dave had travelled to Salisbury to find something big, heavy and armoured to get through the massed hordes that must be waiting there. There was no way of contacting Sarah and telling her to sit tight and wait. He could only hope she was being smart and staying hidden. Howie looked down at the recruits sleeping. Thinking of them as recruits made him smile a little. They were just boys, really. None of them older than 18 and they had been sent to join the Territorial Army by a new government scheme to give young unemployed people some experience of life and instil discipline in them. Thirty lads had only just arrived at Salisbury Army Centre on Friday when the outbreak started. They'd been excited and full of anticipation. Now there were only nine left, and they were willing to listen and learn from Dave. None of them had to go with Howie and Dave to London, but they knew that by staying together they had a greater chance of survival. A groaning noise alerted Howie and he tuned in, listening intently into the night. He flicked the high-powered flashlight on and swept it around in a slow arc. A zombie was crawling towards them. Howie aimed the GPMG, then paused, knowing that the noise would wake them all up and possibly draw more of the undead to them. Howie clambered up through the hole and dropped down to the ground. He then reached into the cabin and pulled out his beloved axe, walking slowly to the zombie. The undead was crawling pitifully slowly and his legs looked mangled and crushed, but still he worked his way forward, groaning with anticipation at the thought of biting into new flesh. Howie crouched down, off to the side, and watched the zombie turn and start towards him. The flesh on the face and arms was very grey with a sickening pallor. The stench of rotting flesh oozed off the zombie and made Howie pull his head back in disgust. The eyes were still red and bloodshot, and Howie noticed that the hands were cut down to the bones from having to drag itself along the rough ground. Howie stood up and shook his head at the disgusting creature. He took the axe and stepped forward, raising it high and then sweeping it down directly onto the neck to remove the head. As the axe flew through the air, the zombie looked at Howie and made a sound that terrified him. Howie jumped back with a shout as the axe struck, missing the neck and cleaving into the head. He dropped the axe and fell back onto the ground, sitting still and staring at the now dead undead. Dave came running up and looked down at the cadaver, and then at Howie. He said, 
my name, Howie stammered. Chapter 19 Sarah wakes up slowly as the bright sunlight streams through the smart black blinds covering her bedroom window. Dust particles dance and shimmer in the air from her soft breath. Long, dark strands of hair spread out across the expensive silk sheets of the king-sized double bed. Sarah sits up slowly and looks at her reflection in the mirrored doors of the built-in wardrobes. She looks intently, with a look of concentrated determination which slowly morphs into sadness. With a long sigh, she shimmies over the bed and stands up, stretching her arms and legs out. Sarah then walks into the ensuite bathroom and reaches for the light switch, but the electricity went out a couple of days ago, and she curses herself for forgetting. She checks the cold water tap and is pleasantly surprised that clear water still gushes out. She starts to brush her teeth and looks longingly at the large glass-sided shower cubicle in the middle of the room, then sniffs at her armpits and pulls her head away from the stale smell of body odour. There are pans and pots on every surface, each filled with water and covered with cling film and aluminium foil. Sarah knew that once the electricity went out she would have to preserve her supplies, so quickly filled every available receptacle from her small apartment. Even the kitchen sink is full of clean water, and she hasn't flushed the toilet for a couple of days now. The warm weather has meant that she's been sweating lightly nearly all the time, especially at night when the air is so still and hot. Her tight black vest top clings to her body from moisture. Sarah has been washing with cotton cloths and only using the water sparingly, but now, after several days, she longs for a shower. The air is so warm and humid, and she can just imagine the cold water spraying onto her sticky body. Sod it, she says to herself, and quickly strips her clothes off, leaving them in a pile on the floor. Naked, she steps into the cubicle and turns the dial. A powerful jet of freezing water pummels into her skin, taking her breath away and making her squeal. The cold water is pleasant torture and she soaks herself, watching as goose pimples come up on her arms and legs. She quickly scrubs her body with soap and washes her hair, turning the shower off as the last of the bubbles are rinsed away. She steps out and takes the thick cotton towel hanging from a hook. She walks back in front of the bathroom mirror and stands naked, holding the towel down at her side, enjoying the feeling of the warm air drying her wet skin. After a few minutes, she's dressed in jeans and a baggy t-shirt and finally goes into the lounge area, a small room with a kitchenette on one end. The apartment was subsidised by her employer, one of the perks of working for a large corporate bank. The downside was that she had to respond to work whenever she was called, and that was quite often during the recession. But even a tiny apartment like hers in a swish block would cost a fortune, far more than she could ever afford. Sarah finally plucks up the courage and steps to the large windows, pulling the blinds up. She slides back the single patio door, steps out onto the tiny balcony that overlooks most of central London, and glances down onto the streets below. Her heart sinks as she sees the thousands and thousands of zombies crammed into the streets. Even the road is not visible because they are so densely packed. The only times she has seen crowds like this are for huge royal weddings or the London Marathon. But these aren't crowds waiting for a glimpse of someone famous. These are hordes of rotting, dirty, filthy zombies that want to eat human flesh. Sarah shudders and steps back inside. She closes the door, but then opens it slightly in defiance. They're down there, and as far as she is aware, they haven't tried to climb up to her, and the apartment needs fresh air. She walks over to the fridge, and again forgets that the power is gone, it is now empty as she's eaten all of the perishable food and is now onto the tinned goods. Sod it, she says again, and steps over to the wall cupboard. She closes her eyes and reaches in. She knows there are some tinned goods inside, and she's been making herself select them at random so that she doesn't just eat the nicer things first. She feels for a tin and quickly pulls it out, holding it in front of her face as she slowly opens her eyes and peeks down at the tin of... tuna. Sod it. She opens the tin, takes a fork, and sits down on the sofa to slowly munch through the dry fish. Giving up within two mouthfuls and going back to the cupboard, she mooches through the various bottles of sauces and condiments, deciding on an almost empty bottle of barbecue sauce. She shakes the thick liquid down to the cap end before squirting it over the rest of the tuna and mixing it in. 
She starts eating again, and whilst doing so, her mind travels back to Friday. A trendy wine bar was what Howie would call it, and Sarah smiles at the memory of her brother making jokes about her whole life being a trendy gym, a trendy apartment, and a trendy social life. Sarah knew, though, that success in her line of work depended on being able to socialise or network, so she made contacts within all of the communities of the financial district. Friday evening was the same as any other. Calls were made, emails were sent, text messages put out, and the in-crowd descended into central London for drinks and tapas at Charlie's, which was owned and ran by the sleazy Charlie himself. He was always trying it on with the female staff and customers, despite his wife working there. Tapas was appointed with sleek black minimalist furniture and exposed wooden flooring, and photos of pebbles and stones in various poses finished the scene. Sarah knew that it was stomach-churning, fake and contrived, but business was business and it had to be done. So she laughed at the right times and gradually made her way through the crowds with her colleagues. A simple black evening dress was all that she wore. Simple, elegant and classic was how her close friends said she looked, which was exactly the look that she aimed for. Too many of the female financiers showed way too much flesh out of the office and it just didn't feel appropriate to her. Her dad had always said, if you want to be taken seriously... You have to act seriously. And his words had stuck throughout her short career. Younger than Howie by two years, she had moved to London at the tender age of 23 and had been here for two years now. The shine of the city had already worn off and Sarah knew it wouldn't be long before she wanted out of it. Sarah had seen the desperation of the older people clinging to their power and fortunes and trying to stay with the in-crowd all of the time. This just made her sad and more resolved to get out when she could. Smoking had saved her life. It's not often that people can say that. Sarah had been addicted for years and controlled the habit by having the odd couple of cigarettes at lunchtime and then after work. So many of the young financiers were health freaks, using the company's gyms and clubs during lunch hours or after work. They called it having a sesh. Sarah was amazed at how many of them used cocaine and did so in public, but would then shun the smokers, calling their habit dirty and cancerous. Taking the opportunity to nip outside and just managing to avoid the grope being offered by Charlie, she talked with her co-conspirator and smoking colleague, Lisa. They chatted as they walked around the side of the building into a quieter side street and both lit up, giggling like schoolgirls, inhaling the smoke and relaxing with idle gossip. Well, that Jonathan tried it on with me last night. I just knew he would, the dirty bugger, Lisa said. He did? What did you do? Sarah replied. What do you think I did? I told him that I'm a strict Catholic girl and you should bugger off, Lisa said in a very serious tone, then cackled evilly. Oh, you didn't, you naughty girl. Sarah laughed, waiting for the juicy details of the illicit encounter. A scream came from the front of the trendy wine bar and it made them both jump. They darted forward to look around the edge of the building. They were just in time to see Charlie standing there in his expensive designer jeans, brown boots and tucked in black shirt, with his podgy stomach pushing against the material. A very pretty girl with long blonde hair was shouting loudly at him as he backed away with his hands raised up in front of him, palms facing her, acquiescent and trying to shush her. You filthy bastard, you grabbed my ass! The woman screamed at Charlie, then slapped him hard across the face, causing his perfectly styled messy hair to get dishevelled. Charlie backed away and begged the woman to keep her voice down. She became angrier and started throwing more haymakers at him. One of the large bouncers stepped forward and restrained the woman, pulling her back. You crazy bitch, Charlie shouted, and ordered the bouncer to take her down the street. He had that coming, the sleazy pig, Sarah said. Oh, he's disgusting, he's always grabbing my ass and trying to squeeze my tits, replied Lisa. I don't know why we keep coming here. It's always the same people and the same thing, and that dirty sleazebag trying to grope anything that moves. He's a sex pest, Sarah said. You know what I heard? He just got back from his brother's wedding in Greece, where he got off with the bride's best mate, and now he keeps going down to see her, right under his poor wife's nose, Lisa said. Someone should report him to the police. That's got to be sexual assault or something, Sarah said. Oh, hang on. It's not quite over yet. A well-built man with a bald head came storming up the street, straight towards Charlie, who was now talking to his two bouncers. As the man got closer, he pointed directly at Charlie. Do you grab my girlfriend's ass, you dirty fucker? 
the man shouts as he gets closer. Charlie quickly starts stepping back, hiding behind his bouncers. One of them moves forward and extends an arm out to the man, a clear warning to stay back. The man knocks it out of the way and quickly punches the bouncer in the face, causing him to fly back and knock Charlie into a set of tables, upsetting the drinks all over the nearest customers. The second bouncer moves in to grab the angry man but gets headbutted and sent flying too. Charlie is on his feet and moving backwards away from the angry man. Please, mate, please, take it easy, calm down. I didn't do anything. It's all a misunderstanding, Charlie pleads, seeing his two bouncers down on the ground, clutching at their faces. Sarah and Lisa are laughing hard, watching Charlie beg the man to stop, whilst backing away into more tables and knocking drinks over. The bald man lunges at Charlie and grabs him by the front of his shirt, then throws him down onto the floor. Sarah, Lisa and half a dozen other previously groped women all cheer at the sight of the sex pest getting his just rewards. The angry man glances around at the sound of cheering and smiles awkwardly at first, confused about the reaction. One woman shouts out the cheers and whistles, Go on then, have him! He's grabbed all of us, the dirty beast! The bald man smiles at the woman and bows his head before walking intently towards Charlie, who's scurrying away on his backside one hand up in the air, still trying to defuse the situation. Please, mate, I didn't do anything. If you touch me, and I'll get the law on you. There's CCTV here. The man bends down and pulls Charlie to his feet by the front of his clothes and punches him once in the face. The women erupt in cheers and start applauding. People pile out of the main door to watch the action and more join in by clapping. The man hits him again in the face, and the crowd cheer even louder. Someone shouts, Two! and the man pounds him again. The crowd shouts, three! The man isn't hitting him hard, but hard enough to stun Charlie and humiliate him. The bouncers are back on their feet now and are starting forward to help their boss. A woman steps out from the crowd and stands in front of them. Don't do nothing, he got this coming! The woman shouts at the bouncers in a strong Eastern European accent. That's the wife then. Lisa laughs as the crowd shout, four! A loud shout erupts from over the road and Sarah looks over to see another fight taking place. Jesus, this place is getting worse. Look at them going for it. Lisa stares over and they both watch as a man is being attacked on the ground by another man. Some other people run over and start to pull the man away by grabbing at his shoulders and body. The man is thrashing about and appears to be trying to force his face into the other man's neck. The attacker then springs up and launches himself at one of the rescuers. Oh my God, did you see that? Sarah asks. Yeah, that's awful, Lisa replies. There's a big ruckus going on now across the road as more people try to subdue the crazy man. He refuses to stop and keeps lunging his head at more people, biting them and causing them to jump backwards. The man who was on the floor sits up after a few minutes and slowly looks around. At least he's all right. I thought he was dead, Lisa said. The man gets to his feet and suddenly lunges forward and bites into the neck of another man. Screams and shouts erupt and the bald man, holding the now bloodied Charlie, stops pounding and looks over at the mass brawl taking place. He lets Charlie go, who slumps to the ground, whimpering. The crowd are all silent now. Some people are running into the melee and some are trying to escape. One woman dressed in a smart black business suit staggers out of the confusion, clutching her neck, blood spurting out between her fingers. She staggers across the road and falls, and the bald man tries to catch her and lower her gently to the ground. The man shouts for something to stop the bleeding and presses his already bloody hands into the side of her neck. Women are screaming and men are running about in panic. The fighting gets worse and more people get involved, until nearly the whole street is brawling. Sarah starts to take in some of the details. Despite not being experienced in street fights, even she understands that biting is not a normal action. We should get out of here, Lisa murmurs to Sarah. What? Christ, yes, let's go, Sarah responds, shaking herself. Sarah and Lisa start down the main road, but quickly see that the road ahead is also blocked by people fighting. They turn round and try to go the other way, but that too is blocked. What the fuck is going on? Lisa shouts. I don't know. Quick, down here. Sarah grabs her hand and they start back towards the entrance to the side street that they were smoking in just a few minutes ago. They pass the front of Tapas again and Lisa screams as she sees the bald man being pulled down by the woman in the smart business suit. 
The woman is biting into his neck, gouging the flesh away, and hot crimson blood is pouring down her face. They scurry past and enter the darkness of the quiet street. Both stop halfway down to take off their high heels and run in bare feet. They burst out of the street into another main road, also swamped with cafes, restaurants and wine bars, and hundreds of screaming people covered in blood and clutching facial and body wounds. Sarah and Lisa run down the pavement, dodging around people fighting. Blood spurts out from an arterial bleed, soaking Lisa on her face and bare arms. They continue to run, narrowly missing being attacked by inches. Within a short distance, they reach Sarah's apartment block. Come in with me, Lisa. You can't stay out here on your own, Sarah says, panting heavily. I can't, Sarah. I've got to get home. Lisa breaks away and starts running down the street. I'll call you when I'm home, she yells. Sarah watches her run, then turns to go into her own block, but movement to her left catches her eye, and she sees a man staggering into view. His shirt is blood-soaked, and half his face is torn away. He sees Sarah and starts directly towards her. Sarah fumbles at the numbers on the key-coded entrance lock. Her fingers move too fast, and she has to press clear and start again. Finally, she pushes through the door and slams it shut behind her. In the foyer, Sarah presses the button to call the lift. While waiting, she peers at the front door and watches the man through the glass, staggering past the door. Then he stops and walks towards the plate glass. Sarah pulls back and urges the lift to move faster. The doors open with a loud ping and Sarah gets inside and waits for the slow climb to her floor. She doesn't hear or see anyone else and gets safely into her flat. She then pulls her mobile phone out of her bag and curses that she forgot it was on silent. The screen flashes with missed calls from home. Her parents have been calling her again and again. She presses the phone and waits for the connection. Her dad answers and lets out a loud sigh. Sarah, oh, thank God you're okay, he says. Dad, what's happening? There's loads of fighting and people being attacked and a man had his face hanging off, Sarah babbles into the phone. Sarah, listen to me. The phones will be down soon. Something bad is happening everywhere. I don't know what it is, but you stay in your flat, okay? You must lock yourself in and wait for us. Howard speaks slowly and firmly, making sure she takes it all in. Dad, what? What's going on? Are you and Mum okay? We're fine, Sarah. Your mother's right here. We're going to get Howie, and then we'll come and get you. Wait there. Do not go out or leave the flat. Is Howie okay, Dad? Is this everywhere? I've been out in town and it was awful. Yes, Sarah, it's everywhere. Now you must stay there. The line goes dead. Sarah panics and yells into the phone over and over again. Dad! She presses the end call button and tries to call them back. She keeps trying again and again, then calls Howie, but gets no tone. And then she works her way through her call list one by one. All around the world, people screamed into their phones, desperately trying to make contact with their loved ones. The huge numbers crashed the networks and the engineers were busy fighting for their lives like everyone else and couldn't bring the systems back online. Sarah had never had a landline connected. The mobile signal in most of central London was always brilliant and the building provided secure wireless connection. Sarah tried using her computer, but the internet was down too. After hours of frantic calling and texting, she gave up and sank onto the sofa, curling up and sobbing. After some time, she remembered the television. She'd rarely watched any TV. Sarah flicked through the channels, but each one was either blank or showing a static image apologising for the loss in broadcast. Those were the events of Friday. Now it's Tuesday, and there is still no sign of her family. Sarah finishes the tuna and discards the empty can into the waste bin. She's feeling a little stir-crazy and yesterday sneaked out to knock on her neighbour's doors but there was no reply, and she ran back inside her own apartment. She knows that she has to keep mentally alert and that regular physical exercise releases endorphins into the system. She grabs her iPod and changes into a pair of shorts and a sporty vest top. Naturally, very slim and lithe, regular workouts in the company gym helped keep her fit and toned. Selecting her gym playlist, Sarah commenced exercising, again cursing herself that she had the shower first instead of waiting. For the next two hours, 
Sarah punishes herself with hard physical exertion, running fast on the spot, then doing star jumps, squat thrusts, push ups, and sit ups. Then she makes use of the kitchen worktop for dips. Loud dance and rock music blare directly into her inner ear, pushing her to work harder and faster. Eventually, she flakes out, crashing down to the floor, gulping air down and pulling the small white speakers out of her ears. As she recovers, she tries to think how many apartments there are in the building. There are many floors, maybe 20 or 25, and most of the apartments are small so the developers could make more money. So, maybe four apartments per floor, apart from the big luxury ones at the top, that would make it around 100 apartments in my block. There must be someone else alive in this building, and there should be a decent amount of water storage to supply the apartments, which must mean there is plenty of water. So, I can have another shower. Sarah runs for the bathroom before she allows any doubt to creep in. Again, having showered under the pleasantly cold water, she gets dressed and makes her mind up. She's going to go out of her apartment and see if anyone else is still here. What harm can it do? Sarah selects a large knife from the kitchen drawer and starts towards the front door. Sod it, she exclaims as she slowly opens her front door. Chapter 20 Ah, oh, who did that? Alex exclaims. Cookie! Cook bursts out from underneath the Saxon, clutching his nose. Tucker, was that you? Stinky fucker! Cookie shouts back after taking a few steps away. Tucker chuckles to himself and then lets rip with another loud fart, causing more of the recruits to burst away from the rear of the vehicle. You dirty fucker, Darren Smith yells as Tucker carries on laughing. I start giggling myself from my spot at the top of the Saxon vehicle. Dave took the last look out during the night and I got another couple of hours sleep before the sun finally came up. What time is it? Nicholas Hewitt stands and stretches out. It's just gone 6am, I say, out loud, so they can all hear. You lot feeling any better today? I get a mixed response. Right, we need to make a move. Load up, and we'll go back to the main buildings and find some food. Hang on, I need a piss, Simon Blowers calls out, and runs out from the Saxon, stopping after a few metres and relieving himself onto the grass. Within minutes, he's joined by all of us, in a row, pissing in the warm summer morning, contented sighs and long groans sound out as bladders are relieved. I'm bloody starving, Tucker says. No surprise there, then. Cookie says to a cackle of laughter. Stop talking about food, I feel like my throat's been cut, Curtis Graves says. What? You didn't even do anything last night, Gravesy. You were pissing about driving that Land Rover all night while we were fighting for our lives, one of them shouts, and then they're off again, bantering and jibing. We slowly load back into the Saxon, and I take the driver's seat. The Bedford 500 six-cylinder engine roars to life, and I engage the first gear and pull away. The Saxon is a big, squat-looking thing with massive tyres and can hold up to ten soldiers in the rear. From looking at the controls, I can see it has two-wheel and four-wheel drive capability, but I leave it in normal at the moment. The ground is hard and compacted from the scorching hot summer, and the Saxon makes light work of it until we reach the smooth surface of the road that leads back into the main area. I familiarise myself with the vehicle while we go over the low bumps, causing the lads in the back to bounce around. I think back to the night before, when the zombie said my name. I theorise that it must have been just the body expelling air, and in the eerie night my imagination made it sound like my name. You're right, mate, I say to Dave. He's sitting in the passenger seat of the cabin. Yes, Mr Howie, he replies, deadpan as normal. You hungry too, mate? I'm famished. Yes. So, what do we need to do? Get some food and go to the armoury. Anything else? I don't think so. More ammunition and a bit more kit from the stores would be good. OK, mate. Food first, though. We could split up and use the two teams we had yesterday, one for cooking and one for getting the stuff with you. OK, Mr Howie. I'm sure most of the lads are doing the same as me and thinking only of food in their stomachs. We follow the road for several miles. The plains are massive and stretch out on either side as far as the eye can see. Eventually, we drive into the main building area, there are undead bodies littering the ground everywhere. 
Flies and insects are buzzing between the cadavers, and I realise just how much of a disease risk all of the corpses across the country are. Right, everyone out, I call, as I bring the vehicle to a stop on the large parade square. We will split into two teams. Tucker, you're on Team Alpha, aren't you? Yes, sir, he replies, but looks worried. Team Alpha will come with me and get the grub ready. Team Bravo are going with Dave to get what he needs from the stores and the armoury. Right, who knows where the food place is? It's called the mess, sir, and it's over here. Tucker starts off immediately, followed by the members of our team. Stop right there! Dave bellows out in his drill sergeant voice, and everyone freezes, including me. I look around quickly, trying to identify the threat, my assault rifle already raised up. I see Blowers and Cookie are doing the same. Where are your weapons? Dave shouts, and I realise that half the recruits have got out and started moving off, their rifles still in the Saxon. Get your weapons and keep them with you at all times! Dave's voice does the trick, and they scramble back to the Saxon and gather their weapons, looking sheepish and embarrassed. I nod at Dave, and he nods back. See you in a bit, mate. Say an hour? Will that be long enough? Yes, Mr Howie. We set off to the mess, and I wonder why the army has to have such weird names for everything. The mess looks like most of the other buildings from the outside. The door leads into a corridor which opens into a large canteen-style dining room with long tables and benches. There is a long-serving counter at one end. Hot plates and cold cabinets are dark and cold. Tucker walks down the room, rubbing his hands. I don't know what they'll have left. I guess the meat might be off by now. What day is it? Tuesday. We'll see. There might be something decent we can use. I'll go and have a look. He's in his element now. He is the official cook and food supplier for our band of misfits. I follow Tucker into the kitchen area, which is spotless and very modern looking. Huge ovens, multiple sinks and various equipment are around the sides. There are lots of work surfaces in the middle. Tucker walks through, taking it all in. Have you done cooking before then, Tucker? I ask him. I was joining the catering corps, sir. I love food and always have done loads of cooking, as you can probably tell. He jiggles his large belly and laughs. Ah, here we are. He opens two large metal doors that lead into a huge walk-in chill room. Won't that all be off now, mate, if the power's been off for a few days? I ask and follow him inside. The army uses a different power supply to the normal grid. It's gone now, but I was hoping it stayed on long enough to keep this lot chilled. Plus, these are very well insulated from the heat outside, so it takes a while for the temperature to rise. I see what he means. Although the power is definitely out, the chilled room is decidedly colder than the kitchen or the outside. Now, let's see. They must use the lilo method, so we just need to work out where that starts, Tucker says as he starts rummaging through boxes and packets. The what, mate? I ask him. The lilo method means last in, last out, which means they have a system to see when the freshest stock is added, so they use the oldest stock first. Ah, I see, that makes sense. Tucker identifies the freshest line and starts pulling boxes out into the kitchen. I call the rest of the lads and we start a chain, piling it up on the work surfaces until there is a considerable mound. I start poking through and see boxes of red meat, beef and whole chickens. I smell each of them in turn, but they all seem quite fresh. Tucker walks back into the kitchen as I'm sniffing. They must have had a delivery of new produce on Friday, so we're lucky this lot is still good, he says. Are you using all of it? I ask him, surprised at the pile of goods. Might as well. It'll only go bad otherwise. He stops and stares at the pile, and immediately starts separating them. Tucker is by far the least fit of the recruits, and he gets a lot of stick for it. But watching him now, he looks focused and very happy. Anything we can do, mate? Roland McKinney asks Tucker. Oh yes, the power is still on, Tucker exclaims as he turns a dial on one of the gas hobs. Then he checks if the oven is working. Right, Roland, can you grab some of those pans and fill them with water? Darren, if you start cutting these up into small chunks, Tucker thrusts a box at Darren and moves on to Nicholas Hewitt. Nick, can you start chopping the veg, please, mate? Anything I can do, Tucker? I ask him. 
Uh, no, sir. Thanks anyway, but we can manage. I leave them to it and make my way back out of the building and across to the parade square. The Saxon looks massive. It must be over two and a half metres in height and over five metres in length. I feel more optimistic about our chances of getting through London, but again, the delay concerns me. These lads didn't have to come with us into the plains yesterday. I know they said that sticking together increases the chances of survival, but getting that Saxon was my objective, and I did it to rescue my sister. I put them in danger for my own ends. In the church, when the ammunition ran low and we were seconds from being invaded, not one of them moaned or said a word, but they stood together and prepared for the worst. So, the least I can do now is give them some time for food and rest. I meet Dave at the Saxon, and we watch the recruits bringing boxes of ammunition out. Dave takes the magazines out and stows them in compartments in the vehicle. Then he does the same with the spare rifles and ammunition for the GPMG. Then more clothing. And finally, some NATO helmets. Once loaded, we head over to the mess and walk into a wonderful aroma, a mixture of meats and sauces that sets my mouth watering at once. Tucker has done an amazing job. There are bowls and trays of food in the middle of one of the tables. A few minutes later, and we're all tucking in, piling plates with food and shoveling it into our mouths without manners or etiquette. There are laughs and jokes around the table as everyone eats their fill. Dave stays quiet and eats an enormous amount of food for such a slightly built man. We sit back, relaxed and contented, and drink strong coffee. So I'm going to head to London with Dave. I promised I would drop some of you off on the way. I let the question hang in the air. Sir... If it's all right with you, I'd rather stick with you two until you get to the forts. I haven't really got anywhere else to go. Blowers speaks first, his voice steady and decisive. Yes, mate, of course. But going to London is going to be hard. Are you sure this is what you want to do? Yes, sir. I think Cookie feels the same way. We talked about it earlier. Blowers looks to Cookie, who nods in affirmation. I won't last five minutes on my own, and besides, someone has to do the food and make the brews, Tucker offers. That's great, mate, thank you, I say to Tucker. McKinney, what about you, mate? Well, I want to see my family, but I know they would have headed with everyone to the forts. If they haven't... I understand, I interject, to try and save him the hardship of having to say it. But there's no point me trying for home on my own, especially after seeing what they're like at night. So, if it's okay, I want to come with you too. McKinney looks down at his empty plate, clearly uncomfortable with feeling like he has to ask. Lads, Dave and I would be more than happy to take you all with us. You've proved yourself, trust me. It's not me doing you a favour, it's the other way round. I'm going to head off, sir, if that's all right, Alan Booker offers suddenly. No problem, Alan. Where are you heading to? I ask him. I'll try home first and then the forts if that fails. I live in the other direction, so I'll find something to take, save you having to drive away from your direction. Alan, after what you've done for us, mate, it's really not an issue if you need a ride somewhere, I say to him. Nah, thanks anyway. I can take something to use, he says but looks sheepish and avoids eye contact. How will you take something, Alan? Even Dave and I struggle to find transport at times. It's not as easy as you would think. Nah, you'll be okay. I sort of know how to take cars without keys, if you know my meaning. Ah, misspent youth, though, mate. Well, it's a pity to lose you. Feel free to change your mind. Thanks, Mr Howie. I really appreciate it. Alan is the only one that wants to leave. The others try and convince him to stay, but I can see his mind is made up. Half an hour later, we're driving out of the gates and down the road. Alan insists on being dropped off at the main junction, and he gets out with his rifle, ammunition and rucksack. There's a silence after he goes, and we drive on quietly. The recruits have been through so much together in such a short space of time, and the loss hits them hard. Cookie makes an effort to crack a joke, but it falls flat. Now, are the rest of you sure that you want to come with us? I shout back to the lads. Because there's going to be a lot of zombie motherfuckers that need killing. 
Dave and I did want to keep them to ourselves, but seeing as you lot have helped out, we're willing to share them. But not if you're going to be holding back. A few muttered responses. Oh yes, a whole lot of zombies that want to eat brains. A few chuckles this time. Brains, I must have them brains. I groan the words out and then look across at Dave. Eat Dave's brains. A few more laughs, especially when Dave looks at me with his usual deadpan expression. Cookie no have any brains to eat though. They laugh properly this time and start ripping on Cookie, who takes it well and abuses them back. The tension is broken, for a little while at least. Chapter 21 Sarah treads softly down the carpeted hallway, creeping forward and stopping at the first door. She knocks gently and listens with her ear pressed to the door, and after a few seconds of silence, she tries the door handle and is not surprised to find that the door is locked. She moves down the corridor, checking each door, knocking and listening, and then slowly pushing the door handle down. Sarah hasn't heard any noise from the neighbouring flat since the event began, which is unusual because she can normally hear the muted tones of the televisions, music being played, or the tones of voices. She realises that she has never heard anyone from above or below her apartment so has nothing to gauge whether the occupiers will still be there. Her floor is finished quickly. There is no noise, and all of the doors are locked. Out of habit, she moves towards the lift doors and goes to press the call button, only remembering at the last second that the power is out. She moves to the fire door and slowly pushes it open, looking down into the stairwell. The apartment block is modern and finished to a high standard. The developer went to the extent of carpeting the emergency stairwell and having brass rails fitted. Some of the more health-conscious residents used the stairs for a daily workout. The carpet is light brown, carefully selected to absorb moisture and street dirt from the boots of delivery drivers. The developer also thought to add glass panes to each fire door so that natural light filters into the stairwell. Up or down, Sarah whispers to herself. Living on the 14th floor meant she was just over halfway up. She stands still for some minutes, considering which way to go. In the end, she chooses to go up, knowing it will be quicker for her to run back down the stairs if she has to escape anything. The memories of seeing the undead bite into the living makes her shiver with fear as she starts to ascend the stairs, keeping to the central carpeted section to deaden her footfalls. There are two sets of stairs between each floor, and she is at the next landing door very quickly crouching behind the door and listening, then raising herself up slowly to peer through the glass pane and out into the corridor. The view is exactly the same as her floor, carpeted corridors with four apartments, two on each side, and a large picture window at the end. She creeps out until she is through the doorway and gently closes the door behind her. She repeats the actions from her floor, moving from door to door. Each apartment is quiet and the silence only serves to add to the tension and fear she is feeling. She moves stealthily back to the stairwell and climbs up to the 16th floor. By the 19th floor, she's more nonchalant and the knife is held down at her side rather than up and ready. She still tries the handles but her movements become less stealthy and covert and she spends less time at each door. By the twentieth floor, the knife is in her back pocket and she walks normally down the corridor and knocks loudly at each door before trying the door handle, not bothering to listen this time. Thinking that there is clearly no one there, the whole block must be empty, she makes her way back down the corridor and into the stairwell. Up the stairs and onto the twenty-first floor, again she knocks and tries each door handle, but there's no sign of life. Where is everyone? she mutters. She goes back into the stairwell and climbs further up, her thigh muscles still aching from the two hours of exercise. Feeling hot, thirsty and sweaty, she reaches the 21st floor and pushes the door open before stepping into the corridor. Thinking of a cold drink and another cold shower, she reaches the first door and her fist freezes in mid-air as she goes to knock. The door is wide open. Her heart starts beating faster and her breath catches in her throat as she looks down at the bloodstains beneath her feet. She looks back down the corridor to the stairwell door 
and curses herself for not noticing the red smeared footprints on the light-coloured carpet. Deep red, dried blood smears are all over the high-gloss white wooden stairwell door. She slowly follows the bloody footprints on the carpet and looks towards the end of the corridor. Her heart skips a beat as she sees the man that is facing her. He has drool coming out of his mouth and his eyes are all bloodshot, like he has a serious disease. His skin is drawn and tight against his face and Sarah can see that his normally dark black skin has gone shades paler, almost grey. The man rocks gently as he stares at her and his head rolls about seemingly uncontrolled. He is dressed in white shorts and a once white vest top that is now heavily stained from blood and saliva. The man groans and starts to shuffle slowly towards her. His movements are slow and jerky as he moves. He slowly spasms and twitches, flicks his arms out and causes his head to jerk quickly to one side. Terrified, Sarah stands still, watching the man shuffling towards her. Then she comes to and darts forward into the open doorway with a squeal, slamming the door behind her and running into the lounge area. The apartment has the same layout as hers, but with different furniture and decor, which makes it feel surreal. She pulls the knife from her pocket and turns back to face the door, listening intently, her heartbeat thudding in her ears. An old zombie woman shuffles on thick carpet slippers into the lounge. Saliva dribbles from her old and puckered mouth and coats the front of her nightgown. She inches towards Sarah, the bloodshot eyes staring at the tender skin of Sarah's bare neck. Sarah's heart is pounding and the blood rushes through her temples, deafening her senses. She waits for the sound of the man against the door and tightens the grip on the knife handle, but a sudden noise behind her causes her to spin around. She screams as she sees the old woman, a massive ragged gash in her neck. She lunges at Sarah with her lips pulled back. Sarah yells and jumps backwards, at the same time thrusting the knife forward, plunging the sharp blade directly into the old woman's chest. The zombie is knocked back, but then continues forward again. Sarah backs away, staring at the knife handle embedded in the woman's chest. She is trapped in the short corridor between the lounge and the front door, and within a couple of steps, her back is pressing against the door. The old woman keeps coming, each small shuffling step bringing her closer and closer to Sarah, who stares in horror at the skin that is torn away from the open neck wound. Sarah waits until the old woman is two or three steps away and lunges forward again, grabbing the knife handle and pulling it free. She stabs, plunging the knife back into the zombie woman's chest, but again gets no reaction. The dead woman is pushing against Sarah and has again pulled her lips back to reveal worn-down old yellowing teeth. Sarah stabs furiously in a blind panic and then uses her hands to drive the woman away. The old woman zombie falls to the floor from the power of the blows and Sarah yanks the blade free and staggers back to the door. The elderly zombie slowly sits up and starts bending forward to stand. Oh, fuck off, Sarah cries out and without thinking pushes the door handle down and pulls the door open. The zombie man is standing in front of her and Sarah screams again and lashes out with the knife, slashing him across the face. His skin peels apart like dried fruit, and blood seeps down into his mouth, turning the saliva pink. Sarah feels the old woman against the back of her leg and spins around to see the woman reaching towards her. She stamps down on the zombie woman's head and drives her face hard into the floor, feeling the crunch as the nose is broken and teeth are knocked out. The zombie man staggers in, spitting bloody drool, and Sarah stabs out hard and fast, puckering his chest and abdomen. She moves backwards, but gets stuck by the old woman's body. In desperation, she raises the knife high in both hands and drives it into the skull of the zombie man as he lunges forward for the bite. The blade forces through the skull into the brain, and the force of the blow drives the zombie down onto the floor. Whimpering and full of panic, Sarah jumps over his body and dashes out into the corridor. She screams loudly as she sees another zombie coming out of the next apartment, shuffling towards her. Sarah backs away down the corridor, unarmed, the knife still embedded in the zombie man's head. She backs down to the stairwell door and turns to run away, suddenly seeing another ravaged and bloodied face staring at her through the glass pane from the stairwell. 
Fucking hell! Sarah moves away from the door. Turning round, she sees the old woman zombie crawling out of the apartment doorway into the corridor. The other zombie man advances slowly and Sarah hears the door being pushed open behind her. With a yell, she slams her body into the door, sending the zombie behind it flying backwards. She spins around, trapped again, desperately trying to think of a way out. She looks down at the wall and the bright red plastic case of the fire hose and instantly starts tugging at the large door to open it up. The door stays shut. Sarah loses valuable seconds, fumbling to keep open the clasp. The stairwell door starts to open and Sarah kicks out hard, slamming the plate glass into the face of the zombie. Blood spurts out from his broken nose, coating the glass pane. Sarah pulls at the hose and the heavy metal head, yanking it free of the reel. The large red metal head has arrows depicting on and off. Sarah fumbles with the tap head and twists it the wrong way, in her panic. The door swings open and the zombie lunges into the corridor. Sarah swings the heavy metal hose head and batters him across the face, forcing him to spin into the wall behind him. She twists at the tap head and hears as water surges through the hose, sending it rigid, but no water comes out. She pulls the lever and gets thrown backwards onto the floor by the sudden release of the water shooting out of the end. The hose dances and bangs against the walls, forcing gallons of water out into the corridor, soaking everything. Sarah is drenched within seconds and has to fight against the powerful spray to take hold of the metal head. She picks it up and turns it back towards the stairwell door, straight at the zombie man. The powerful jet of water knocks him back through the door and into the stairwell. The door swings closed, causing the water to spray back and soak Sarah again. She spins round on her backside and directs the jet at the next zombie man, again hitting him from close range at centre mass and knocking him clean off his feet and down onto the floor. The old zombie woman has crawled close to her victim and Sarah forces the jet of water directly into her face. The woman's skin is pummeled and forced back as she gargles and chokes on the water, but she keeps crawling forward. Sarah leans over with the hose so that it's right in front of her and the jets force the zombie woman's head back as the water is pumped down her throat. Finally, the old woman dies again as her lungs fill with water and her stomach lining expands from the sudden fluid intake. Sarah gets to her feet and switches the lever off, the sudden loss of pressure causing the hose to drop down a few inches as she turns back to the stairwell door. Sarah marches forward and kicks the door open to see the zombie man just getting to his feet, balancing on the edge of the top step. Fuck you, Sarah shouts and pulls the lever back. The powerful surge of water takes the zombie clean off his feet and down onto the next level. Sarah pulls the hose through and slowly steps down the stairs, her feet squelching in the sodden carpet. Sarah directs the hose at the zombie, spraying it across the short landing and down the next flight of stairs, a look of grim determination on her face. The hose extends far enough for Sarah to jet the zombie out of the next door and into the corridor of the 20th floor. Then she rushes forward, spraying it further down the corridor, buying herself time to run back to her own apartment, tears streaming down her already soaked face. Sarah sprints to her door, lurching through and slamming it behind her. Then she slumps down, sobbing and soaked through. Her mind races at what she has witnessed. When this first happened, she'd suspected it was a mass breakdown of civil order and general violence that had happened recently in London and other English cities. Then she spoke to her father, who said it was everywhere. Sarah has been running his words through her mind ever since. What did he mean by everywhere? He couldn't mean worldwide. Surely not the whole world. Zombies and vampires are make-believe, something invented for the movies. They can't exist. Something so frequently seen on television can't just happen. But all the things I've seen must be believed. Zombies have risen up and are roaming the land. Sarah sobs for a long time, unleashing the pent-up misery and isolation of the last few days, crying hard for her family, friends and the people she has seen being taken down. Tears course down her cheeks and her body heaves as the sadness pours out of her. Eventually wet through and shivering from shock, she staggers to the bathroom and pulls off her soaking clothes. She uses the thick cotton towel to dry her body, moving like a robot, without expression.
thinking only of what she'd just witnessed a few floors above. Thinking of the decaying bodies that stank of death with greying skin and saliva drooling out of their mouths. The red, bloodshot eyes and the horrific injuries to them. She had stabbed that woman again and again, but still she kept coming. And Sarah replays the action in her head, feeling as the knife bit into the rib bones and jarred her wrist, the suction of the skin as she pulled the knife out, and the fresh blood spurting from the injuries she had caused. The thoughts and images become too much, and her stomach heaves as she drops down with her head in the toilet bowl, puking up the tiny tuna meal she had forced down. She stays there for a long time, retching and sobbing into the toilet. Chapter 22 We sit in the Saxon with the engine switched off. We only left Salisbury a short time ago, and we've already passed through several small villages as we progress through the country roads. The first village centre only had a handful of undead in the centre, all of them gathered once again in the heart of the village, shuffling and groaning in the scorching sun. They're not getting much of a tan, are they? Considering how long they've been out in this heat, I say to Dave, who's sitting next to me, staring at the mini horde as we drive past. No, Mr Howie, he replies. You'd think they'd be burnt to buggery by now. Possibly. But then there's something in the body, isn't there, that causes the skin to get tanned? I guess dead people just don't tan very well. Pigs do. What? Pigs can get sunburnt. No way, pigs can't get a suntan. They can. Well, I always thought that cows explode if they don't get milked. Do they? I don't know, I heard that they did. Oh, I've never seen one explode on its own. Well, maybe it's not true then. Hang on, what do you mean? Not on its own. Well, I haven't. So have you seen a cow explode then? Yes. How did it explode? I blew it up. You blew up a cow? Yes. Why? How did you blow a cow up? I put explosives on it and blew it up. You did what? You can't go around blowing cows up. I had to. Why? Why on earth did you have to blow the poor cow up? To kill the cow herder. What, you blew a fucking cow up just to kill a cow herder? Yes. That makes no sense. Why didn't you just kill him? I did. No, I mean, why didn't you kill him some other way, like shooting or stabbing or strangulation or something other than blowing him up? It had to look like an accident. A fucking accident? Oh yeah, because cows are always exploding where I live. How on earth can you make an exploding cow look like an accident? He was a courier for explosives. Oh, I see. Well, I guess that makes sense then, I think. He carried explosives for the insurgents, so we rigged the cow to blow up and took him out. Oh, where was that then? I can't say, Mr Howie. I knew he was going to say that. Fuck me, look at that lot, I shout and hear the recruits scrambling forward to try and peer out at the front. Zombies ahead, Tucker shouts from his lookout position on the GPMG. No shit, really, Tucker? Where are they? Cookie yells back. Ahead, Tucker shouts down. I was being sarcastic, Cookie calls out. What? Tucker yells. I said I was being sarcastic, Cookie bellows out. You want some elastic? Try my bag, there might be some in there, mate. Oh, for fuck's sake, Cookie groans. Give it up, mate, it's a lost cause, McKinney offers. So here we are, sitting in the Saxon, looking at a massed horde blocking the road ahead of us. The village doesn't look that big with just one main road going through a collection of shops and houses. There is a village green off to the right, bordered by a metal fence, and the horde is gathered up against the fence. They start slowly turning around to face us. Well, that's a shitload of zombies, I say to Dave. It is, Mr Howie. Do you think that the APC will get through them? Might do, Mr Howie. Right, lads. Buckle up, I call back. Tucker, hang on tight, I yell up. 
What? He yells back. Ah, he'll be all right. I restart the engine and push my foot down, making the engine scream with power. I slowly lift the clutch and the vehicle shoots forward and stalls. Not a word, I say, as I hear sniggers coming from behind me and try again, going a bit easier with the clutch this time. The vehicle surges forwards, gathering speed quite quickly. We plough into the front of the horde, and the hard metal square front detonates their heads and bodies, sending them spinning off and knocking more over. I plough through and feel a slight bump as the massive tyres crush the undead beneath us. The vehicle hardly rocks on the suspension, and within seconds we're through them, leaving a trail of broken and squashed bodies behind us. The lads all cheer and whistle, and I can hear Tucker shouting something. I stop the Saxon and look over at Dave. Did you see that? Fucking brilliant! This thing is awesome! I sound like an excited child babbling away. They were smashed apart and we hardly felt a thing! Yes. I use the side wing mirrors to look back and see the mangled remains and those not so injured picking themselves up off the ground. Would be a shame just to leave them there, mate, I say to Dave with a grin. Do you want to go back again? He asks me. Yeah, we could. Or we could do it the old-fashioned way. Dave turns to look back at the recruits in the back. Blowers, get those bayonets from the box and show the rest how to fit them. Yes, Dave! Blowers answers promptly and somehow makes the word Dave sound like Sarge. I reach down to the floor and lift my axe up. It's all shiny and clean, feeling nice and heavy. I test the blade with my thumb and jerk my hand back from the unexpected sharpness. I sharpened it, Dave says. Bloody hell, thanks, mate. You still got the knives, then? I say, as he suddenly has them in his hands. I didn't even see where they came from. I put new blades on these, too, he says, staring along the sharp edges. I can hear the recruits talking quietly and then clicking noises. One of them yelps. I fucking told you it was sharp, didn't I? Blowers says with scorn. Then, after a few minutes, he shouts out that they are all ready. I feel the adrenaline start pumping, and the anger is knocking at the door, waiting to be let out. I pull the axe and climb down from the high driver's position. The zombies are shuffling closer to us, and I hold the axe down at my side as I walk around the front of the vehicle to meet Dave as he climbs out. The lads jump down and walk back towards us, holding their rifles carefully due to the massive, nasty-looking blades at the end. Safety's on, Dave says to them, and they all look down to check the side of their weapons. Strike and move. Use the weight of the weapon to drive them back with repeated stabs to the chest and torso. Use the butt of the weapon for blunt trauma. The bayonets are sharp and will slice through their jugulars easily. Be very careful if you have to fire the weapon in close confines. The round will rip through the body and come out the other side, instructs Dave. An impressively long speech from him. Finally, Dave turns to me and nods. I start to walk towards the encroaching zombies and stop. Ready, lads? I ask of the young recruits. Yes, Mr Howie. They nearly all mutter. I turn and stalk towards the undead. The last few metres I stare hard at the nearest one, a large-built male, and I feel my eyelids twitching, my mind filling with the image of my beloved parents being bitten by one of these foul things. The axe is down at my side as I step closer. Time slows and I feel my right fist clenching, and before I have any idea what I'm doing... I've slammed my hard fist into the side of the zombie's head. I follow through with the punch and slam him across the road. He staggers into another undead but stays on his feet, and I'm on him before he can react, punching again and again with my right fist. The blows send him down onto the ground, and I go still, waiting, breathing. I feel them surround me, I feel their presence, and I close my eyes in anticipation. The danger of being so close to these evil things thrills me. The infection they carry is all around me, 
Their teeth are being pulled back and they step and shuffle closer and closer. But I am death and I come for you. I open my eyes and scream into the air as I spin the axe up and around, slicing through skin and bone. I drive the cutting edge towards necks and feel the sharpened blade bite and slice through their evil, tainted, infected skin. I step backwards and drive down a massive overhead strike, cleaving through a skull and watching as brains burst out and the head implodes. My senses are heightened and I feel one lunging at my back. I step back and drive my elbow into his face, dropping him instantly. The axe is alive, an extension of my body. We are one, and we destroy those that stand before us. I chop into heads and necks, slicing faces off, biting the vicious blade into collarbones and spinal columns as they fall at my feet. I plough forward, swinging and killing. A quick glance over and I see Dave moving like water through them, his arms spinning with grace and beauty. A strange man with an amazing gift, moving like a ballet dancer. His whole body poised, flexing, bending and stretching with each killing blow. He darts forward and plunges the knives into the chest of a zombie woman. His arms are blur as he rapidly stabs and then slices through the jugular and drops down to avoid the spray that soaks into the eyes of the next zombie, blinding him. Dave spins around the back, dragging the blade after him as he lunges forward, driving the point of his other knife into the throat of the next one. I go back to work and cleave my way through the bastard horde. The evil, foul things that walk this world after their natural life has expired. I kill and maim and leave broken, undead bodies behind me. Then I break through into a clearing and rejoice as I see a freshly and densely packed group ahead of me. The anger has only just warmed up. It has stretched out and flexed muscles and is now ready for the proper workout. I look back and see Blowers driving into them with a look of pure fury on his face. Cookie by his side, the banter and easy jokes gone now as they tear the undead apart. Tucker is screaming with hatred and fear, hacking away. McKinney, Smith and all of them are in amongst them and the bodies fall down with hacked and bloodied injuries. I turn back to the horde ahead of me just as Dave gets to my side. We stare at each other, words not needed, and we charge together, roaring into battle. Dave launches himself high into the air and comes down into them, his knives doing the deadly business of sending them back to the hell from whence they came. My axe is breaking them apart. I pick my targets, one by one. A neck gets cleaved and the head drops down. I swing the blunt end back and I crush a skull. I drop the axe low and strike up into the bollocks, destroying the undead's chances of ever breeding his evil spawn. I spin and swing the axe behind me, chopping a zombie arm off at the shoulder. Then I go low again and take a leg off at the knee joint. This doesn't kill them, but it pleases me to maim and hurt and make them fall down onto the bloody and slick ground. We keep going, chopping, slicing, hacking and destroying until one dirty zombie remains and we gather round him. Silent faces. Hard breathing. The zombie turns around and around, unable to decide which one of us to try and bite. Me, Blowers, Cookie, McKinney, Smith, Tucker, Graves, Reese, Hewitt and Dave stand around this one remaining filthy, dirty, evil zombie fucker. We stare hard at him and I see the anger inside each of them. There is glory here. Glory in battling alongside brave warriors such as these. Dave steps forward and takes the zombie by the back of his hair, wrenching his head back and pulling him off his feet. I roar and raise the axe high, driving it down into the exposed neck. As the blow lands, the recruits pile in and the zombie is punctured by eight sharp points from eight sharp bayonets being pushed by eight brave young warriors that have been pushed to the brink by these evil things. The body is hacked apart, unrecognisable within minutes. We walk silently back to the Saxon, taking long gulps of water from our canteens and nodding at each other. 
That was fucking beautiful, Cookie says quietly, to nods and murmurs of agreement from all around him. We use wipes to clean the blood from our weapons and skin and then load back into the Saxon. At least you didn't bum him this time, Cookie, Blowers says. Fuck you, Blowers, you were stabbing him in the willy, Cook retorts. The willy? Are you ten or something? McKinney joins in. You were stabbing them in their zombie willies, Tucker laughs loudly at the infantile language being used. You can all get fucked, Cookie shouts, and the abuse goes on. I drive the Saxon away from the village, away from the devastation and the bodies lying festering in the sun. Chapter 23 all over the world, the infection feels the losses from these survivors. The infection feels its size dwindling as the fighters become more deadly and more cunning in their resistance. Small groups gather and organise themselves, securing supplies and learning how to take the deadly hosts down during the daytime, and then hiding themselves away in strong and secure locations that the zombies cannot penetrate. They take away ladders and ropes, lock strong doors and remove the keys, use the underground networks and anything they find that still works. The rats have progressed the rate of infection significantly, and their small, wiry bodies have been able to get into places that the human hosts were unable to access. But they are easy to kill and put down. Through millions of eyes, the infection watches these fighters, and it understands that in order to survive it must target these first. The infection again watches as the one called Howie leads his fighters in an attack and kills many hosts, and the infection watches through those millions of eyes to see when they will reappear so it can send the rats into them. Inside the minds of the test hosts, the infection continues to play with the brain and learn more of the complex secrets this thing possesses. It already understands that the hosts were not fully in control of these brains, and, like itself, it knows the brain is a work in progress, still in the early stages of evolution. The infection allows the mind to access memories and knowledge, but the billions and billions of images and thought processes just cause confusion, as they are in no order and have no sense. But the infection controls many now, and can work on these images while the hosts rest and repair. The infection now knows that the same strengths, cunning and guile possessed by the fighters are locked inside these mines, and it will work hard and fast to unlock them. Unlock them not just to take more hosts, but to fight back. To buy itself time, the infection urges the rats on, devouring everything in their path. The success of the rats has spread across the world, and soon they are scurrying over every street and road worldwide. Bite, but don't kill is the message constantly replayed in their tiny brains. They work as a super organism, and even the hardest and toughest resistors are consumed with panic as the Black Plague comes for them. Chapter 24 we enter another small village and find a horde gathered outside of florists. The once beautiful flowers in the window are now wilting. This horde is small in number compared to the previous one, maybe a dozen of them at most. I see a child zombie in the group this time. Thankfully, I haven't killed any child zombies. Yet. A couple of days ago I would have blanched at the thought of it and been sickened to the core. But now I've hardened, and they are not children anymore. They are undead, and they will kill given the chance. They must be dealt with, like any other undead. Can we stop, please, Mr Howie? Dave says to me, snapping me out of my thoughts. Yes, mate. Why, what's up? I ask him as I bring the huge Saxon to a halt, causing the recruits to cram forward. Practice, Dave says simply, and indicates the small horde. Okay, mate. The recruits clamber out and gather round Dave at the back of the vehicle. I look at the horde, itching to go for them and take them all out. You did well with the last lot, but you were clumsy and slow. We're going to practice on these, Dave informs the recruits as I lean on my axe. T 
Take off the bayonet, and I will show you some basic techniques for using it as a bladed weapon. The recruits do as instructed, and remove the bayonets from the end of the assault rifles. Now, weapons back in the Saxon, and follow me. They place their assault rifles back in the Saxon, and then walk with him towards the horde. The sun feels uncomfortably hot. The zombies have turned towards us and started their slow shuffle, but I parked well back to give us time to arrange ourselves, so there is no immediate rush. The recruits gather around Dave, holding the knives self-consciously out in front of themselves, glancing at each other and the horde. Now, you can stab them in the chest, but that won't kill them. It buys you time, and the weight of the thrust can drive them backwards, but it is not a killing blow, do you understand? Dave asks and looks at them in turn as they nod. The only sure way that I have found of killing them is the neck and head. Even after repeated stabs to the chest and abdomen, they still fight back, so they don't die like normal people, but they do bleed. The bleeding is different enough, though. A few stabs that would normally render a man lifeless within seconds do not seem to affect them in the same way. The way round that is to cause them a massive loss of blood that even they cannot cope with. Now, watch. Dave walks towards the horde, holding his knives down at his sides. The nearest undead is an adult male, middle-aged and fat. He's wearing a pink, frilly dressing gown that is open. His wobbly bits dangle as he shuffles along. Now take it easy, Cookie, I know what you're looking at. Blowers mutters to a few sniggers. Yeah, you're just jealous because he's bigger than you, Cookie retorts. Dave turns back to look hard at the lads, who fall silent under his intense gaze. Then he simply walks up to the zombie and stabs him once in the chest and leaves the knife embedded in. He quickly steps back as the zombie bares his teeth and lunges forward. See here, this one is now stabbed through the chest with a long-bladed weapon. This would normally drop even the strongest of men, but he does not even flinch. Dave calls out, and the recruits watch as the undead continues to shuffle forward with the knife handle sticking out of his chest. Dave steps in and stabs with the other knife, driving that one down to his lungs. So now he has two knives in his chest. I have punctured one of his lungs, but still he does not react, nor does he slow down. Dave points at the undead. He then steps forward and quickly pulls both blades out, causing the zombie to stagger forward a little from the pressure of the pull. Now, a lot of the damage from stabbing is done when the weapon is removed. The embedded blade can cause a seal around arteries and capillaries, and the removal of the weapon breaks that seal. But here we see that although there is blood loss from the wounds, it is far more reduced than with a normal person. Their blood congeals much faster than ours, which means that they can withstand injuries such as this. Dave turns back to the recruits to make sure they understand. Most of them nod and murmur with interest. So a stab will only be of use if it has a single purpose, to drive them back, like this. Dave lunges with frightening speed and stabs repeatedly into the chest and abdomen of the zombie. His arms blur, and although I've seen him move in several battles now, I'm still amazed. The zombie is forced backwards from the many punctures and eventually falls down onto the ground. Dave steps away and faces the recruits, not the slightest out of breath. He is still alive or dead. Undead. Dave scratches his head and stares down at the zombie trying to rise back up. Anyway, the repeated wounds would have not killed him, so we have to look to the rapid blood loss. Dave steps forward and sweeps his blade across the zombie's throat, stepping behind him and facing back to the recruits. See the arterial blood spraying out? There is nothing known that can congeal, stop or replenish that amount of blood loss in that short space of time. The recruits watch the bright red jet of blood spurting out in waves from the throat, soaking the pink dressing gown and the ground beneath. Within seconds, the zombie rolls over and is still. So, we go for the throat or the brain, but the brain is protected by the hard casing of the skull and requires a significant use of force. 
Dave steps to the next zombie and lightly taps the point of his knife into the skull. The skull has to be thick to prevent injury to the brain, so here I am hitting the skull with light force, and other than causing minor puncture wounds, I do not affect the brain at all. Now, as I increase the force used, you will see that even a significant amount does not penetrate the bone. Dave keeps walking round the adult female zombie, digging the tip of the knife into her head. Now, in order to penetrate and drive into the brain, you must apply direct force. Do not sweep or slash. Drive the point of the weapon directly into the top of the head. Dave pulls his arm and slams it down, causing the knife to dig into the skull. Then Dave lets go and the body falls to the ground, with the knife still stuck in the head. Blood is slippery and can easily cause you to lose grip on the handle, and you need a similar amount of force to pull the knife back out. You can see that with a wet handle and the weight of the body dropping, you could lose your grip and then have no weapon. Dave bends over and grabs the fallen zombie female by the ankle, dragging her over to the recruits. I want each of you to feel how hard that blade is stuck in. The lads all gather around the female zombie's head and take it in turns to pull at the handle, remarking to each other in serious tones how really hard it is stuck in there. This has got to be one of the most surreal scenes I have ever witnessed. A group of 18-year-old lads standing round a dead zombie, discussing how well the knife is stuck in her brain in a quiet village in southern England. Dave then puts a foot on the zombie's shoulder and pulls the knife out, then leans down and wipes the blood on the back of her nightdress. Right, I want each of you to find a zombie and try it out, Dave says as he cleans the blade. Blowers, Cookie, McKinney and Smith all move forward to do as Dave says. Tucker hesitates, then he too moves into the crowd. I watch the lads dodge around and through the zombie horde and try to avoid their last second lunges. Blowers and Cookie both go for the same zombie and start arguing about whose it is until Tucker grabs the back of the head and slices cleanly through the neck, dropping the body before smiling and walking back to Dave. They both stare after him, open-mouthed. A determined look crosses Cookie's face and he stalks off to viciously pull a head back hard and gouges down into the flesh, sawing away until he almost decapitates it from the body. Eventually, they are all dead, apart from the zombie child who drools and starts toward Dave. The rest all watch with mixed looks of horror and revulsion. Dave stares hard at the zombie and starts forward with his knives. Before he has taken two steps, I've rushed in with the axe and sliced clean through the neck. The body falls slowly to the floor, blood pumping out onto the hot tarmac. I stare back at the recruits until they all look down to their feet or off into the distance. It's not a child anymore. They're not people. They will kill you and turn you into one of them. Don't hesitate next time. I walk back to the vehicle with a mixture of feelings, guilty because it was still a child's body, and everything we are ever taught in life is to protect children at all costs. They are the future. Even though I told them it wasn't a child, it has left me feeling numb. The fuel gauge drops steadily, and I realise the biggest flaw of having a vehicle this size is that the fuel consumption is so high. We will need to refuel before too long. Dave looks at me, having followed my gaze. I can see that he remembers the last time we tried to refuel by putting diesel into a petrol-only tank. We almost got caught by a massive horde as night fell. Don't worry, mate. I'll make sure it's the right kind this time. Thanks, Mr Howie. Before long, we pass through yet another village, but this one is devoid of life. I slow down so we can look closely, but there are no bloodstains or broken windows. Nothing. This doesn't feel right. Every village we have passed through has had some zombies in it. Who's on lookout? I call back to the recruits. McKinney! Rhys shouts back as he is the closest to my end. Ask him if he can see anything from up there. Rhys stands up and speaks with McKinney, who yells down, 
He said, no, sir, he can't see anyone. Strange, I say, and Rhys continues leaning forward to look out of the front window. Certainly is quiet, he murmurs. What's up? One of them calls from the back. We're going through another village, but it's completely dead, if you'll pardon the expression. There's no one here, Rhys calls back to them. I hear more of the lads shuffling along to try and glimpse out of the front windows. Can I open the rear doors to look out? One of them shouts. It sounds like blowers, but he must be at the back and the vehicle is loud. Good idea, I shout out, and the message gets relayed. I suddenly hear more noise from the massive wheels going on the road. We drive out of the village and into a country lane. There are wooden signposts stuck into the verge, advertising a farmer's fate this weekend. Then, as the road bends around, I see the top of a large white marquee in a big field off to the left. As we get closer, I can see the tops of cars and vans parked in the adjacent field and a gap in the hedge connecting the two fields. The signposts indicate to turn left for parking. I slow down to try and get a better view, but the hedgerow is too high. I hear McKinney shouting, and I decrease the speed even more, waiting for the message to be relayed. McKinney says they're all in the field by the tent. Loads of them, sir, Reese leans forward and tells me. Well, we've got to have a look, really, I say to Dave as I stop the Saxon. There are bloody loads in there, sir, McKinney says as I clamber up onto the roof. I stand up and look over the hedge and see a large flat field with a big white marquee off to one side. There is a roped-off circular central area and then some smaller tents and marquees around the outside. This explains where all of the village zombies have gone. They're all here. Hundreds of them have gathered in and around the large marquee, hundreds of undead in various types of night clothes, all completely naked. From a distance, it looks like some weird sex party or a fancy dress shindig, with everyone coming in their pyjamas. Fucking look at that, I mutter to myself. Don't see that every day now, do you? No, sir, McKinney answers. Well, we can't stop and kill every zombie we see, but I feel bad if we just leave them here for some poor helpless soul to wander into, I say to McKinney. Do you want me to use this, sir? I look at McKinney and he taps the top of the GPMG. Dave, how much ammo do we have for the GPMG? I shout down and then see Dave is already climbing up onto the roof. I'm sorry, mate, I didn't mean to yell. That's okay, Mr. Howie. We've got loads, Dave says. All yours then, McKinney, I say to him, and move off to the side so I'm well out of the way. A large grin forms on his face, and McKinney yanks back the lever and aims the gun into the middle of the horde. He hesitates for a few seconds and glances at me again. Mate, you don't have to do it. Someone else will, I say to him. He shrugs and lets rip with the heavy machine gun. The noise invades the quiet air and the zombies immediately start falling as they are torn apart by the heavy caliber weapon. The recruits all look up at McKinney and I know some of them will be jealous that he has the chance to use it and kill so many. Movement catches my eye and I see Dave waving at me, pointing to the GPMG. I shout out for McKinney to stop firing. Once silent, I shake my head from the sudden cessation of noise and look down at Dave. He's got a large metal container out from the back of the Saxon and opens the lid. The things inside are instantly recognisable. I've seen them a thousand times in movies, but never in real life. Hand grenades. Dave gathers the recruits around him, apart from McKinney, and shows them how to remove the pin and keep hold of the lever, then pull the arm back for a long throw. Dave leads them all up the lane and into the car park, then through the gap in the hedge until they're in the field and staring at the already reduced numbers of the zombies. I can see Dave talking to them, but cannot hear what he's saying. From his movement, I guess that he's telling them to throw it far and then find cover. There is a large tractor with an evil-looking giant metal contraption fitted to the end.
Dave leads them all over so that the tractor attachment is between them and the zombies. He then pulls the pin out of his grenade and uses a big overhead sweep of his arm to launch the grenade into the middle of the packed crowd, shouting, Grenade! as he does so. The explosion that takes place a few seconds later is a lot bigger than I'd expected, and I see several bodies blown up a few feet into the air and many more drop down from the shrapnel ripping through legs and stomachs. Dave then makes them all take turns to throw a grenade each and shout, Grenade, as they launch it. McKinney and I watch with oohs and ahs like a firework display as the grenades explode and cause devastation to the horde. The zombies closest to the exploding grenades are obliterated with each loud percussive bang. The lads finish lobbing their grenades and I can see that they're smiling and laughing at the carnage that has been caused. Dave gives me a thumbs up as they leave the field and it's safe for McKinney to continue. The GPMG starts up again and within seconds they're all dead or at least down and unable to get back up from their awful injuries. That was fucking amazing. Do you see them explode? I fucking love blowing stuff up. Darren Smith says excitedly as they walk back to the Saxon and load up into the rear. Are we going to stop at every village on the way, sir? Blower shouts to me. It would be nice, but we don't have the time, mate, I reply, thinking how everyone is calling me sir or Mr Howie now. I'm just a shift manager for a supermarket. How the hell did I end up leading a squadron of zombie killers across the country? Chapter 25 The infection recognises this group of resistors that keep cutting it down. It watches the one they call Howie who is standing further away, watching as the hosts are destroyed and the infection is once again diminished. The infection now controls billions of hosts across the world, so this handful of losses does not impact it greatly, but the infection feels the loss. Although it does not have emotions or feelings, it has an understanding that this must be stopped. The resistance fighters grow stronger and their numbers increase as they join together and wreak devastation during the daytime. They use bigger and better tools to aid their killing and find new ways to destroy the hosts. The infection knows from the chemicals inside the hosts that it should be feeling anger and it begins to understand what revenge means. It continues to experiment on the few host bodies across the world that it keeps isolated to practice with. Those few hosts separated from the hordes suffer incredible amounts of torture as the infection floods them with the chemicals it learns to produce. The hosts scream in pain and collapse on the floor with rigid tension when the pain becomes too much. They dance and jump around and move quicker and quicker as the infection learns to control the flow of electrical impulses to the tendons, nerves and muscles. They break down and cry when they are filled with a sudden, overwhelming sense of sadness and loss, weeping uncontrollably and pounding their fists into their heads in desperation. Then they suddenly burst up and start giggling with glee. The giggles become louder until they are laughing uncontrollably with the sudden switch in chemicals coursing through their bodies. The chemical flow is switched again, and the laughing stops. They become suddenly serious and stare hard into the distance as the infection pumps the blood and makes them feel anger. Then the anger increases until they are filled with a burning rage, a rage that needs to be fed with violence and an urge to destroy everything around it. The infection feels this rage through the host's bodies and knows this is something it can use. The practice hosts are pumped full of this deadly hormone and they are released from control to do as they wish and they move with lightning speed to pound and destroy anything near them. Those that are alone, without access to inanimate objects, turn on themselves as the blind fury possesses them. They gouge their skin and bite their fingers off, then pummel their own bodies with vicious blows, breaking ribs and knee joints. Some of the control hosts are near other host bodies, and they turn on them with an amazing ferocity. They attack and kill the other hosts with an incredible strength, and the infection allows them to continue, watching through many eyes, the attackers, the witnesses, and the victims. 
The rage is too strong, though, and the control hosts spend too long on one body ripping it apart with their bare hands and teeth, shredding the flesh and pulling the insides out to throw them down on the ground so they can be stamped upon. The control hosts hurt themselves to the point that they cannot function and drop down to the floor, being so unable to cause the destruction they crave. They turn on themselves and rip their own bodies apart. The infection has found something here, something it can use, but it has to learn to harness this power. So as the first control hosts are killed by their own demented actions, the infection takes more control hosts, and in every land, there are single zombies that suddenly stop rolling their heads and groaning. They look forward, and intelligence comes back into their eyes, as they step away from the hordes they are with, to stand alone. Chapter 26 Sarah wakes on the sofa, the sobbing and crying had left her feeling drained, and she slept fitfully for a few hours, with horrific images coursing through her sleeping mind. What she experienced has shocked her to the core, and a deep feeling of sadness, loss and desperation overwhelm her. She doesn't know how long she can keep going, unable to leave her apartment and struggling to survive on just the few tins of food she has left. She paces through her apartment, which helps her to think, and forces her mind to work rationally. She can now use work skills to break the problems down into small chunks. What do we know? She starts speaking to herself as she would at work when faced with a difficult or complex matter. I'm on the 14th floor and I only saw them on the 21st floor. There were no signs of them on any floors between here and the 21st floor. Now there's one on the 20th floor. He did not see which floor I ran to, so unless he can smell me, he cannot find me and I was soaked with water, which will remove any smells. But then I did leave a water trail behind me. Okay, so he could find me. But there were no signs of them on the other floors. I have only a few tins of food left, but plenty of water, so I can survive. But it'll get very hard. Priorities. I need more food. If they are dead zombies, then they cannot survive forever without food or water. They have been outside in the street now for days and I haven't seen them eat or drink anything, so I need to eat and wait for them to die, or die again, or just fuck off and leave me alone. But in order for me to survive, I need food, and that means going back out there for more supplies. She stands still, as she realises what must be done. She nods to herself with quiet resolution. I have to get more food. Going up is no good, so this time I will go down. I also need weapons. She rushes into the small kitchen and goes through her cutlery drawers, waving knives and rolling pins about. She practices with each item, but the knives are no good. Stabbing at them seems ineffective. She moves from room to room, looking for anything that could be used. Eventually, back in the kitchen, she finds a large wooden broomstick that had been left by the previous tenants. She always thought it was odd to have a wooden broom in a tiny carpeted apartment. Sarah takes the broom and holds it up. It isn't heavy, but it is long. She rummages through more drawers and pulls out a roll of brown parcel tape that she used to secure her moving in boxes. She takes a long-bladed kitchen knife and tapes it securely to the end of the broomstick handle. She then moves into the lounge and practices lunging and stabbing with it. It isn't perfect, but it will have to do. And she knows that she has to leave now and try again, or the fear will become too much and she will never be able to leave. She walks to the door and extends her hand, grasping the handle and pausing to calm her breathing and her rapidly beating heart. She then yanks the door open and jumps out into the corridor like an Amazonian warrior, holding the broomstick out in front, like a spear. She faces one way and jumps around to face the other side of the empty corridor. She gets to the stairwell, and each step brings more fear, but courage grows after each step is taken. Sarah peers through the glass pane. There is nothing but silence all around. The only signs of her prior encounter are the wet stains on the carpet, but even they are drying quickly in the hot air. Sarah breathes deeply and starts down the stairs, taking each step slowly to make sure her footsteps are masked from noise by the soft carpet. She reaches the door to the thirteenth floor and again looks through the window into another empty corridor. She advances slowly, and this time 
she opens the fire hose cabinet and pulls the metal head free, making it ready for use. Walking down the corridor with the spear waving in front of her, the bristle end is just behind her back, and she has to keep twisting it so the flat end doesn't catch her on her hips when she pushes the bladed end forward. She stops at the first door, listens quietly, and only when she is sure there is no noise does she try the handle. No knocking this time, she tells herself. Move silently and do nothing to draw attention to yourself. All the doors on the 13th floor are locked and secure. Sarah was surprised when she discovered the apartment block had a 13th floor. A lot of developers still go straight from 12 to 14 out of superstition. Sarah descends each floor in turn. Each time she unlocks the fire hose and pulls the head free in preparation. At the ninth floor, she listens at the first door, hears nothing, and tries the door handle. Moving on, she listens and tries the door handles for each door. At the last one, she pauses for a second as she holds the handle down, resting her head against the door. The tension, fear, and concentration are exhausting, and she rolls her shoulders to ease the pain building across them. Who's there? A voice says softly from the other side of the door, and Sarah opens her eyes wide, suddenly very fearful, and not wanting to release the handle in case it gives her away. Then she realises the stupidity of this thought process. Hello? The voice calls again, a soft male voice full of fear. Sarah releases the handle and steps to the side, not wanting the person on the other side to see her through the peephole. I saw you move. Who is it? The voice asks, still soft and very scared. I live on... She pauses, not wanting to give away her floor. I live on the 18th floor? I was looking for other people and food, she says softly, still not wanting to draw too much attention to her location. Are you alone? The voice asks. Yes, she replies. Sarah hears the sounds of the locks being rotated, bolts and chains being removed and pulled back. The door slowly opens and a man comes into view. Hello, Charlie, Sarah says to the battered and bruised face of the wine bar owner, and he smiles through swollen lips. Chapter 27 Another bland and boring village, another horde, and again we stop the Saxon well back from them. The engine switched off to save precious fuel. The crowd are gathered at the front of some shops on the main road. Don't they get bored? I ask Dave. I don't think so, he replies. It doesn't look like they're focused on anything specific, does it? They're all just aimless. Yes, Mr Howie. I reckon about 30 or so. 28. Oh, uh, OK. So, what is it this time? Rocket launchers? Flamethrowers? Or are we going for samurai swords? Sniper rifle. Dave says and gets out of the Saxon to walk around the rear of the vehicle. Of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? I didn't even know we had a sniper rifle, I mutter to myself as I climb down. The recruits have piled out and are stretching in the sun and chatting quietly. Dave comes out of the back doors holding a long bag, which he places on the ground, then unzips the full-length zip. He removes a long green-coloured rifle. The stock is folded and Dave pulls it out to its full length and then fixes on a long tube to the end of the barrel. He checks the magazine and fixes it to the bottom of the rifle. Finally, he walks over to the middle of the road and lies down, facing towards the horde. This is an L11 5A3 long-range rifle. The scope is a standard day scope which increases the magnification by 25. There are five rounds in the magazine. The weapon has an adjustable bipod so the rifle can be settled while you locate the target. This bit here is a cheek piece. What does that do? Tucker interrupts him to groans from the rest of the recruits. You rest your cheek on it, Dave answers without expression. He waits for a moment, then goes on. The suppressor at the front reduces the range, but it also reduces the noise and flash, which thereby serves to keep the sniper concealed and increase his survivability. Dave pauses to extend the bipod and make minor adjustments, as he looks through the scope towards the gathered horde. 
They have noticed our arrival and have turned to shuffle towards us, but the distance means it will take them quite a long time to get near us. I keep my assault rifle ready, just in case any of them decide to start sprinting. The rifle fires an 8.59mm round. This is heavier than some sniper rifles, but it means the round is less likely to be deflected over long ranges. The range is 600 metres for a solid strike, but it will fire over one kilometre and still be effective. The recruits murmur at this, and I'm shocked too at the great distance this thing can cover. So we settle down and breathe nice and slowly so we're not jerky. Each movement is slow and controlled. You have to take into account wind speed, but in weather like this and over this distance, that is not an issue. Locate your target and keep your breathing controlled. When you are ready, you squeeze the trigger. Do not snatch at it as you will jerk the rifle and ruin your aiming. Squeeze and fire. The rifle makes a coughing noise and I watch a head explode in the middle of the horde as the body drops down amongst them. Okay, Mr. Howie, would you like to try? Dave asks me. I'll try, mate, but you know what I was like with that last rifle. I go over and drop down to lie flat. I snuggle my shoulder into the end of the stock and rest my cheek on the cheekpiece. I always thought that you put your eye right against the scope. But Dave shows me to look through it and locate the target. I choose a fat one, front centre. His head is wobbling less than the others due to his fat neck. Breathe gently, identify the target and move slowly to make adjustments if you need to, Dave instructs. When you are ready, squeeze the trigger. I keep the head in sight. It sways from left to right and I keep focused on the middle of the sway. Breathe slowly and squeeze the trigger. The end coughs and I watch as the head explodes and the bullet rips through, taking the back of the skull off and going into the chest of another zombie behind the fat one. They both fall down and the recruits cheer and applaud as I get back to my feet. You got two. Well done, sir, McKinney says and the rest join in. I grin back at them and Tucker hands me my rifle. I'll go up on the GPMG while you take your turns, I say to them. Then climb in through the back and up through the hole. I check all around to make sure there aren't any sneaky ninja zombies trying to creep up on us. Dave settles each recruit and goes through the same instructions as he did for me. Blow us first, then cookie. Tucker struggles due to his larger size and just pulls the trigger quickly and gets up. Reese goes next and lies down next to the rifle. He calmly settles himself down and stays still for long seconds, making very minor adjustments. He hardly seems to move, and even from this close distance, I cannot see him breathing. He takes the shot, and the round strikes centre forehead, taking the back of the head off in an explosion of blood and brains. He'd aimed for one of the undead at the rear of the group, deliberately choosing a more difficult target. The lads all cheer for Reese, and he responds by going bright red. Try another one, Dave says as Reese starts getting up. He nods and settles back down. That one at the back, the small woman in the pink thing, Dave says. I look over and see a small built zombie woman at the rear of the group. She's shuffling the same as the rest, but her head is wobbling quickly and erratically. Reese settles and pauses for long seconds then squeezes the trigger. The woman drops immediately with her head blown apart. Fucking good shot, mate, Cookie says, and bends down to pat Reese on the back. That was very good, mate, well done, Blower says. Reese blushes even more as Dave watches him closely. Let him do another one, McKinney calls out, and the others all shout in agreement. Okay, I want you to take the one on the far right with the white shorts... And then the naked one on the far left, Dave says. But I want them both shot within ten seconds of each other. Reese nods and identifies both targets through the scope, sweeping from right to left, then back again. He aims for the zombie male on the right with the white shorts and takes the shot. The zombie drops, as before, and Reese racks the bolt and sweeps over to the left and pauses just for a couple of seconds, then takes the second shot. This one strikes her in the mouth, and the zombie gets thrown backwards as the bullet explodes through the back of the skull. 
Sorry, I missed the second one, Reese says apologetically as he stands up. You rushed, and sliding the bolt threw you off a little, Dave says to him. I'm amazed at the criticism. Two headshots like that were amazing, but Reese nods at Dave. Yeah, it felt rushed. I adjusted my position as I reached for the bolt, and I didn't need to, Reese explains. Dave allows the rest of the recruits a go. Nearly all of them miss headshots, and they all seem flat after Reese's amazing efforts. Jamie, you finish them off, Dave says to Reese as the rest of them stand back. Reese nods quietly and goes to drop down. Go on top of the Saxon, Dave tells him, and Reese obliges in silence as he clambers up and the rifle is passed to him. I drop down from the GPMG hole and climb out to join the others. I will number them for you, starting from the front and always moving from right to left as they go back. Got it? Dave calls up. Got it, Reese affirms, quietly. Front centre, large built male, is one. Two is the female with blonde hair. Three is the old man in the striped pyjamas. Dave continues to count them out, showing Reese his method of selecting multiple targets. Ready? Dave calls. Yes, Reese replies softly. Dave waits a few seconds, then calls out, One! Reese takes the shot and the large built zombie drops. Dave calls out, Two! And the blonde undead gets blown away. Dave calls out, Five! And Reese instantly adjusts to identify the target and drops it. Dave keeps going, calling out random numbers. Reese only gets one wrong but all of them are headshots. There is utter silence, apart from the numbers being called out and the coughing noise from the rifle. The last one drops to an outburst of loud cheering and clapping from all of us. Even Dave claps and smiles at Reese as he gets down. Very good, Dave says to him simply, and I see Reese swell with pride from the praise. So we have a sniper in the team, I say to Reese and shake his hand. He looks down clearly uncomfortable. Right, let's get loaded and gone from here. Time is ticking and we need fuel, I call out, and the lads all load up. I get into the driver's seat and look across as Blowers gets into the passenger seat. Dave is showing Jamie how to strip and clean the rifle, so you've got me for a bit, Mr Howie. Okay, mate, no worries. I start the engine and we pull away, driving straight over the bodies, crushing them into the road. The country roads give way to more urban areas and, despite the fuel getting lower, I keep the speed up as we drive through the towns. The signs of devastation and severe civil uproar are everywhere, just like in Portsmouth. Burnt-out cars and vehicles, shop fronts smashed in, and bodies everywhere. Some of the houses have been burnt out too, and there are more signs of fire-damaged buildings the deeper we go. Dave has swapped with blowers now and is sitting up front with me again. Curtis Graves is on the GPMG and the rest of them stay quiet. The villages were quaint, but we didn't really see signs of just how severe the outbreak is. But here is different. It's gritty and it reminds me that a whole lot of people live in this country and every single one of them has been deeply affected by this event. The tragedy is everywhere, in the roads and streets, in the smashed-in buildings with their front doors hanging open. Bloodstains and smears are all over the road and on road signs and metal railings. The bodies that we see are festering and already rapidly decaying in the hot summer sun. We'll take the motorway into London, I say to Dave. OK, Mr Howie. The road leads us through the centre of the town and we see the high street stores have been looted. Debris and everyday items litter the ground. There are very few undead, though, just a couple here and there, shuffling along and slowly turning to watch us as we drive past. A man runs out in front of the road ahead of us, waving his arms and shouting loudly. I didn't see where he came from, although it must have been from one of the shops or buildings. I slow the vehicle down, and he stays in the middle of the road, trying to stop us with his physical presence. I slow to a full stop with him standing just a few feet in front of us. He walks around to my side and looks up as I open the window slightly. Thank God. I knew the army would come, the man shouts. 
He's middle-aged and dressed in suit trousers and an office-style shirt, now filthy with grime. We're not in the army, mate. We're just using this vehicle, I say to him. Well, you've got a man on the top with a machine gun, he shouts back. Uh, well, yes, but we're just trying to get somewhere. You have to help. I got trapped trying to get supplies and I can't get back to my family. I tried to go back, but they're surrounded by those things. The man shouts in desperation and indicates a side street. Tears are streaming down his face and he looks petrified. I glance over to Dave, who shrugs his shoulders. How far away are they? I ask him. I don't want to keep stopping, but he's clearly desperate. Down there. Not far. Honestly, just down there. He moves quickly from foot to foot, pointing back to the side street off to the left. Okay, hop on the ledge and direct us. The man climbs up, holding onto the wing mirror and balancing on the driver's step. I drive forward, and the man keeps waving to the side street and shouting, Down there! Down there! I turn in and drive down the road for a few hundred metres. Down this road! The man waves to a residential street and I see a handful of undead immediately outside a terraced house. Bloody hell, mate, there's only a few of them. I thought you said there were loads. There is loads. Look at them. I'll never get through them. Are you being serious? I look at the man incredulously. What? How am I supposed to get through them? He cries. What about weapons? You must have armed yourself. Well, I'd never really believed in violence and I don't like weapons, he says defensively. Oh, but it's all right for us to use our weapons, I shout at him. But you're the army. We are not the bloody army. I cut across him. You are not going to survive very long without weapons and being willing to bloody use them. But, he tries to stammer. No buts, mate. You said you have a family in there. Kids and a wife? He nods. So man up and defend your family. I push the door open and he falls off the ledge. I take my axe and walk towards the five zombies that are shuffling around his front door. The recruits are bursting out of the Saxon and running towards us with their knives, and Dave is already at my side as I walk up to the closest one and behead him as he turns around. I follow through with the swing and take another one down. Dave has already dropped the other three by the time the recruits get close, and they all stop, looking disappointed, and slowly turn and walk back towards the vehicle. The man is staring open-mouthed at Dave and I, and then at the bloodied bodies on the ground. What's up, mate? Was that too violent for you? I say as I walk past him to the Saxon. We drive back up the side streets onto the main road. I glance back once in the mirror, and he's still standing there, gaping, his arms hanging at his sides. We enter the featureless and empty motorway and keep driving towards London. We have no satellite navigation, just a road atlas. Getting into London will be easy enough, apart from the millions of zombies, but finding where my sister lives will be extremely hard. At least we don't have to worry about one-way roads, no entry signs or traffic build-ups now, and we won't have to pay the London congestion charge. Mind you, I imagine there will still be someone sat in their offices clocking the vehicles and sending out letters to their home addresses. A city the size of London should have lots of survivors holed up, so maybe they have already started cutting the numbers of zombies down. That radio message said that London was infected and to stay away, but that was a few days ago now. I imagine driving through an empty city centre with piles of zombie bodies stacked up neatly, ready to be burnt. It won't be like that, but a man is allowed to dream. There's some services on this road, Curtis Graves calls out. Thanks, mate. How do you know that? I guess you've been here before then. We used to go to 4x4 vehicle shows and take our old Land Rover. Dad always worked out each service station so we could stop if it broke down, Graves says. And did it break down? Rarely. They tend to go on forever, especially the old ones. You just need a few tools and a working knowledge and they're easy to fix. How far up this road, mate? I say, looking down at the fuel gauge that is now only a little bit above the red line. Only a few miles. Not far. Do any of you know how to get fuel out when there's no power? I shout. I know they either have to press a button inside the kiosk to allow the fuel out, or it's done on an automated system when the cameras have had time to record the registration number. Nick Hewitt shouts down to me. 
Well, what about now with no power in the service station? I don't know, but some of the main services have to have backup generators in case of power outages, so they can still get fuel to the emergency services and stuff. Newitt shouts. Curtis, is this service station a large one? I ask him. Yes, sir. It's the only one for quite a while. Okay, we'll aim for that then. We have to get fuel, and Dave has experience with generators. I cast him a glance as I remember him electrifying the metal gates outside the police station. Dave and Curtis, can you two go for the generator? Nick, I want you to try and find out how to activate the pumps if we manage to get the power back on. Darren, you take the GPMG, and Jamie, go up top with the sniper rifle. The rest of us will spread out and keep watch. Got it? I get a chorus of yeses from behind me. I glance over and see Dave staring at me, and although his face is blank, I can tell he's thinking of something. What? I ask him. Nothing, Mr Howie. Was that a bad plan? Change it if you want to, mate. Sorry, I should have checked with you first. It's a good plan. He looks back to the front. It is a very good plan. Chapter 28 Sarah stands in the apartment's entryway with the front door directly behind her, staring at Charlie. Her makeshift spear is lowered but is still pointing towards him, and he keeps glancing nervously at the large blade taped to the end. I didn't know you lived here too, Charlie says. Or you, Sarah says. You've been here long? he asks. A little while. She watches him gingerly touch his bruised and battered face. His lips are still swollen, and the bruising has gone a sickening shade of yellow. It still hurts, he moans. Does it? Although this is the first person she has seen in days, Sarah is not overwhelmed with joy to see the sleazy bar owner. So where is your wife? she asks. Uh, I haven't seen her for a few days. He mumbles quietly and looks away. Doesn't she live here with you? She asks him, puzzled. Uh, well, she did, kind of. He looks very uncomfortable. You left her there when all this was happening. You left her on her own, she demands, her voice rising slightly. Well, it was all going mad and someone had to stay and lock up. I needed to get changed after that crazy man attacked me for no reason. That crazy man was the husband of a woman you groped. I'm surprised it didn't happen a long time ago, Sarah shouts. What woman? A girl with long, straight black hair asks. She has a slight accent. Oh, hello, Sarah says, surprised. Hello, what woman? She repeats. I'm Sarah, nice to meet you, Sarah says. Hello, Sarah, I'm Vivian. The woman is strikingly beautiful with high cheekbones, but with a surly, pouty face. What woman? Vivian looks to Charlie and then back at Sarah. Charlie visibly squirms under her gaze. Excuse me, Vivian, I don't mean to be rude, but Charlie was just telling me how he left his wife at the bar when all of this happened. Not my problem, Vivian shrugs. He left her to die, Sarah says, shocked at the coldness of the woman. Like I said, not my problem, Vivian says again, pouting. So, how did you get here? Sarah asks the woman. Charlie got me from the hotel on Friday night, she replies expressionlessly. The hotel? Sarah asks. I was staying in a hotel near here. Charlie came and got me and we came here. You fucking scum, you left your wife to die and went to get your girlfriend instead? Sarah shouts at Charlie. I didn't know what was happening. I was coming home to get changed and pick Vivian up on the way. You were beaten up for groping another woman and then when the whole world erupts, you slink off to get your mistress from the hotel she's hiding in to have a quickie at home? Sarah shouts loudly now, gripping the spear hard. What woman? You said there was a fight at the bar. Vivian shouts at Charlie, erupting in anger. You fucking cunt! You said there was a fight, but a man beat you up for grabbing his wife? You dirty fucking animal! Vivian screams, her accent getting stronger with the instant rage. Sarah stares in shock at the sudden outburst. 
Vivian turns and walks into the bedroom and slams the door. She reopens it a few seconds later and stands there with her arms folded. You fucker! You got me in a hotel waiting for you and your wife at home and you were touching some other woman. You disgust me, filthy fucker! Vivian shouts, her face contorted with anger. No, Viv, I didn't. I promise I didn't. It was all wrong. Just some mad bloke, Charlie pleads with her. You can fuck off with your promises. You make empty promises. Always empty promises. Viv, please. He looks at her pleadingly. I gave up a life for you. A home with a decent man. I gave up my job and my studies and got into debt. I had a life and you promised me you would take care of me. I even had to pay my own fucking hotel bill. You cheap, dirty man. Uh, excuse me, have you seen what's going on out there? Sarah interjects. I don't fucking care, Vivian screams. Well, I do. As far as we know, the whole world has fallen. That creep left his own wife to die, and now you're arguing about him touching up another woman? Who the fuck are you to talk to me? Don't talk to me, you fucking whore. You're all whores in this country. Vivian screams, the veins in her neck bulging out, and suddenly she isn't so beautiful. Okay, listen, Vivian, those things are in the building, and if you don't keep your voice down, they will come here, Sarah says with a firm, level voice. This is your fault, Vivian turns back to Charlie. This is all your fault, you fucking prick, and now we're going to die in this shithole. Now listen to me, you bitch. You made your choice, and now it's too late, so don't fucking moan at me, Charlie retorts in anger. What? I'm moaning, am I? You promised me a life, and this is what I get, you cheap bloody man. Viv, you're a cheap bitch that you fell for it. That's your fault. What did you expect from me? I'm fucking married, for God's sake. Vivian runs across the room and starts pummeling his body and face with her fists, her long black hair flying about. Sarah slowly backs away, fearing the loud noise will draw the zombies there. She quietly opens the front door and checks the corridor, then pulls the door closed behind her. The sound of the raised voices and glass smashing can still be heard as Sarah reaches the stairwell and quickly goes down to the next level. The noise will draw those things but it will also mask any noise she makes, so she moves quickly onto the next level, trying door handles and then thinking to check under the floor mats. The next couple of floors are all locked and secure, but then she gets lucky and finds a shiny key under a mat outside a door. She quickly listens and then slides the key in, gently pushing the door open. Once again, the apartment is a replica of hers. The layout and the room sizes are the same, just the decor is different. She eases forward slowly, making each step land softly and shifting her weight from foot to foot. The lounge is clear. She checks the bedroom and bathroom, which are also empty, and breathes a sigh of relief as she rushes into the kitchen and checks through the cupboards. The various tinned goods get swept into a bag that she finds in a drawer, plus some rice cakes and unopened cartons of orange juice. Within minutes, she's back outside and replaces the key under the mat just in case the owner returns, and also in case she gets stuck away from her apartment again. Back in the stairwell, she climbs up and pauses when she reaches Charlie and Vivian's floor. She slowly peeks through the door and her heart sinks as she watches the zombie shuffle along the corridor towards the still-raised voices. Sarah shakes her head at the blind stupidity of it all and begins making her way back to her own apartment. On the next floor up, She has to dart back down and hide as a zombie shuffles through the door and into the stairwell. The slow and heavy footsteps resound on the carpet as the cumbersome thing drops down each step. The zombie moves slowly and Sarah keeps backing further down, staying out of sight until the zombie follows the sound of the voices and enters the corridor. Sarah wastes no time and quickly sprints up the stairs until she reaches her own floor, where she checks that it is empty. Then she runs back into the safety of her own apartment, heady with the sense of victory at the accomplished mission and the gained supplies. Chapter 29 We drive quickly down the slip road to the services, following the long, narrow route until we reach a fork in the road. I take the right path and drive into a service station. Several rows of fuel pumps with green and black handles are stretched across the centre. 
The pumps on the far end look bigger, and I guess they're for commercial-sized vehicles. I aim for those pumps and stop before I reach them. Which side is the fuel cap on? I ask Dave, and he jumps out and checks both sides. Your side, he shouts up. Cheers, mate. I slide the Saxon alongside the pumps, while Dave waves me forward and then holds his hand up. OK, lads, let's go, I shout out, and the rear doors are thrown open. The recruits pile out. Curtis runs to Dave and they both set off towards the rear of the building, carrying their assault rifles at the ready. Darren Smith is already up top on the GPMG, and I watch Jamie clamber up with the sniper rifle and then start sweeping the area through the scope. Blowers then directs Cookie, Tucker and McKinney to take a side each. They respond quickly and spread out. I watch them rack their bolts back and make ready. Within seconds, everyone is where they should be, and I glance over to see Nick Hewitt trying to force the doors open. Is it locked? I shout to Nick. Yeah, locked up tight, he calls back. Fuck, I wasn't expecting that. I can't believe it's still locked and hasn't been looted yet. I join him at the electric doors, which are shut tight and secure. I'll get the axe. Hang on. I run to and from the Saxon, and then I take a big swing and strike the glass in the middle, holding my head away to avoid any flying glass. The axe has dented the glass, but that's it. I strike again and again, but the glass holds tight. Security glass, I say to Nick. Try shooting it. I step back and turn around to face the other direction. Nick is going to shoot the doors, I call out, so the others don't panic when they hear the shots. Nick aims and fires once. The round makes a hole in the glass pane, but otherwise no damage. I use the axe to strike at the bullet hole, hoping it has weakened the structure, but it holds fast. Fuck this. Hang on, mate. I run back to the Saxon climb into the back and start checking through the various storage sections until I find a nice, long, thick chain with a hook on one end. I find a hole at the bottom front of the Saxon and attach one end of the chain, then stretch it across to the doors and wind it through the bar handle several times. Once back in the Saxon, I engage the reverse gear and the chain pulls tight. I apply slightly more pressure to the gas, the doors are pulled clean off and get dragged a few feet until I stop and drive back to where we were. Hewitt runs straight into the shop area, and I see him make for the counter. Curtis comes running round to the front towards me. We've got it ready. We should be on it in a minute or so, sir, he yells as he gets closer. Well done, mate. We just need Nick to figure out how to turn the pumps on now. Chapter 30 The infection has tracked the group through the countryside and then watched them trundling through the towns. Each host turns to watch the distinctive vehicle as it drives past them. Then they stopped and took down more hosts. It watched the one they call Howie using that long implement and the other smaller one cutting the throats and causing the precious lifeblood to drain away within seconds. The infection had watched them as the smaller one spoke to the others, and then they all used sharp implements to cut through host necks. Then they stopped again and used another tool to blow the heads off. The infection watched and waited, tracking their movements, and sent the rats out in that area to find them, stop them, and kill them. The rats hunt and watch. The eyes are different than the human hosts, but the sight is still excellent, and the infection watches through hundreds of thousands of eyes, just waiting for them to reappear. Chapter 31 Fucking look at the size of that rat, Cookie shouts, and we all turn to see a big, fat, black rat sitting on the top of a waste bin, off to the side of the fuel station. That's fatter than you, Tucker, McKinney shouts. Fuck off, we like our food, don't we, my lovely? Tucker shouts towards the rat. Oh, they're disgusting, I fucking hate rats, Blowers says. Must be full up from chomping on all those bodies, Tucker says, with gruesome relish. Ah, Tucker, that's fucking gross, you dirty bastard, Cookie shouts at him. I watch the rat watching us. There is no fear in it, and I guess they have evolved and gotten braver. That fucking thing's watching us, Blowers says with disgust. Jamie, 
Do you think you could hit that rat from up there? I shout over to him. He nods and lies down on top of the Saxon, aiming it towards the litter bin. I hear a slight cough, and the rat is blown apart in a burst of pink and black fur. We all cheer, and Jamie gives a slight nod and carries on scanning the area. He's morphing into Dave, I mutter under my breath. Chapter 32 The infection watches the group and the one they call Howie walking back and forth. The smaller one has gone out of sight, but they are all holding those long things that kill the host so easily. The rat sits and watches the group, fully controlled by the infection as it takes in the area. The rat is made to piss down the sides of the waste bin so that others can track its location. Another one pops its head out from some bushes further back and watches the rat on the waste bin. Then another one climbs out of a drain cover and watches the one in the bushes. More start popping out all around the area, watching the others and marking the site, pissing where they stand so that the infection can use their powerful sense of smell. Within minutes, there are rats throughout the fuel station site. Their red eyes almost glow against the darkness of their fur. The scent markers work, and rats from miles around are sent surging towards the location. A scent trail is laid by each rat as it gets closer to the smells left by the preceding rodents. Survivors fighting for their lives against the rats invading their homes are suddenly dumbfounded when the rats turn as one and start running away. They look out of their windows and peek holes to see a thick carpet of black bodies all running in one direction. The motorway that Howie and the recruits used just a short time ago is slowly filling with sleek black bodies and fat black bodies, first in ones, then twos, then small groups, until they are piling in from the sides, the drain covers, all pushing towards one direction. Slowly, the infection is able to watch the group from many different eyes, but it holds the rats back and waits. The infection has learnt to resist the urge to send these small hosts in. It must wait until there are enough to overwhelm them. Chapter 33 Got it! Nick Hewitt bellows from behind the counter. Well done, mate. Nice one, I say from the end of the aisle. I'd just taken cans of warm drinks out to the lads, carrying them in a basket and letting them select the ones they wanted. Then, while I was waiting for Dave and Nick to figure out how to get the power supply to switch to the generator, I stocked up the back of the Saxon with more chocolate bars and snacks. The room suddenly fills with light, and the chilled cabinets start up with a clunk and a whirl. The pumps outside make a noise, and I watch the lads all turn to look at them and start smiling. Is the pump ready, Nick? I ask him. Um, hang on, sir. I'm just figuring it out. How do you know about these things? Have you worked in fuel stations before? No, sir. I just like technology and electrical stuff, computers, that kind of thing. I love figuring out how stuff works. Oh, right. I thought all of you were unemployed. We were. I was. Well, how come, if you can do this kind of thing? There must have been employers out there desperate for blokes like you. I'm dyslexic, sir. He looks up at me with a grin. The army was going to help with that. Well, they were going to, anyway. Bloody hell, didn't they do that at school? Not really. They thought I was pissing around and just not trying, and by the time they figured it out, it was too late, really, and I lost interest. I was bunking off all the time. Oh, here we are. Right, that should be it. Have you done it? I think so. Try it now and give me a shout if it doesn't work, he says as I leave the store and cross to the pumps. I unwind the fuel cap and sniff the hole, just to be sure it's diesel and not petrol. I wouldn't have thought these things would run on petrol. That would cost a fortune. But after the last time we put the wrong fuel in, I double-check. I press the lever in on the black handle and feel the vibration as it starts to pump fuel into the tank. I give a thumbs-up back to Nick, who returns the gesture and starts walking out from behind the counter. Then he stops and goes back and slides up the metal shutter that hides the cigarette display. He looks over at me, gesturing towards the tobacco display. From his manner, it appears he's asking if it's okay to take some cigarettes. Bless him. He doesn't have to ask me. I give him another thumbs up and nod vigorously, showing that I don't mind. 
The fuel pumps steadily into the tank as I watch Nick load up bags with all of the cigarettes, tobacco, papers and lighters and stroll back outside. He goes over to the lads and shows them the contents and I'm surprised when Blowers, Cookie and McKinney all take a packet and light up. Tucker declines and walks over to the Saxon as Dave walks back around from behind the building with Curtis. Do you want a packet, sir? Nick asks me. No, you're all right, mate. I gave up a little while ago. It would be a shame to start now, right at the end of the world. OK. Lads, do you want any smokes? Nick calls up to Jamie and Darren on top of the Saxon. Yeah, I will in a minute, mate. Best not to smoke here with all this fuel about, Darren calls down. Probably a good idea, I say. Is it OK if I go over to the side for a smoke, sir? Nick asks me. Yeah, mate, no problem. Dave walks up and watches the fuel handle. Curtis joins Nick Hewitt and Blowers chatting away and takes a packet of cigarettes, opens it up and lights one. They all stand chatting, blowing smoke into the air, and I notice they keep their observations up and are constantly scanning the area. Fuck me, they nearly all smoke, I say to Dave. Squaddies, Mr Howie, they nearly all smoke. I thought soldiers had to be super fit. There's a difference between being fit and being healthy. Have you ever smoked, Dave? No, Mr Howie. I used to, but I gave up. Watching them now makes me want one, though. Are you going to have one? He asks me. God, no. Far too expensive. I can't afford them anymore. True, they do cost a lot, Dave answers, missing the joke. Or you could just sign for them, seeing as your manager, he says, not missing the joke. Bloody hell, Dave, did you just make a joke? I ask him, shocked at his reference to when I met up with him in the supermarket and tried to get him to take some clean clothes from the clothing section. He had refused, saying he had no money, and I told him I would sign for them. Dave just gives a slight smile, but his eyes are glinting. Well, mate, you are changing. Becoming an instructor, smiling, and even making jokes now. I just don't recognise you anymore. You've changed. You're not the person I met. I smile at him. He looks puzzled and stares at me. I am, he says. I was just joking, mate. Oh, OK. Sir! Jamie Reese shouts out loudly from his position above us on the Saxon. What's up, Jamie? I lean back to look up at him, but he's facing the other way. Sir, there are lots of rats all around us, Reese says. Rats? No, I wouldn't worry, mate. They're just getting brave now that all the people have gone. I don't think so, sir. Maybe you should look. He sounds concerned, and I get Dave to hold the pump lever down while I clamber up top. Where, mate? I ask him, once I'm next to him. Everywhere, sir. Have a look, he says. I take the rifle and look through the scope. I scan quickly from left to right. You're too high, sir. Look down to the bottom of the bushes, at the edge of the car park, Jamie says. I can just see the top of the main services building, where the shops and cafes are. I lower down to the bushes. As I focus and watch, I see black shapes emerging and then staying still. I sweep along the bottom of the bushes and can see hundreds and hundreds of rats, all looking in our direction. I keep sweeping and see more emerging every few seconds, and my heart misses a beat as I notice their small, beady, red eyes. Zombie eyes. Zombie rats. They don't move, though, but just squat still, watching all of us. Everyone, back in the Saxon right now, but do not run, I shout out. I hear footsteps as the lads all start heading back, all of them quiet, and I can tell by the noise they are walking fast. The pump switches off as Dave extracts the nozzle, and I hear the clunk as he rests it back on the stand. More and more rats are coming into the perimeter, and I sweep the scope over the access road and almost shout out when I see a thick black carpet of undulating bodies sweeping towards us. Smith, get that gun aimed on the access road leading in. Is everyone loaded up? I shout down. Apart from you and Jamie, yes, what's going on? I hear blowers say. Lads, there are thousands of rats watching us and more coming. They're wild zombie rats. Jamie, I want you to get back inside, mate. I hear movement as Jamie drops down to the rear and climbs into the back. Smith, you drop down, mate. I'll take the machine gun. Curtis, can you hear me? Yes, sir. 
Graves replies. Get up front into the driver's seat and get us out of here, I say, trying to keep my voice level and calm. I glance over and see that Darren Smith has dropped back down. I lower the sniper rifle and ease myself into the hole and take over the GPMG. I pull the lever back and aim directly at the entrance to the access road. Movement catches my eye and I look over to the shop area. The fuel pumps are covered by a large, flat roof to keep customers dry when they're filling up. The store building also has a flat roof, only inches away from the edge of the fuel pump roof. Black bodies are running and jumping onto the fuel pump area roof. Shit! They're above us! Quick! Curtis, get us out of here! I shout down. The engine starts and I hear Curtis grinding the gears as he tries to select first. Then I hear skittering noises directly above me as the rat's tiny claws scratch against the top of the metal roof. I look back to the hedgerow just as thousands of rats burst out and start running directly towards us. More are coming from the other side, and within seconds, the ground is covered by the rodents as they surge forward. Now, Curtis! I bellow, and then realise that if I open up with the GPMG, I run the risk of hitting the fuel pumps which could blow us all sky high. The Saxon starts forward and rolls away from the fuel area. The rats are already close to the vehicle, and I move around in a circle to see them come from all directions. Curtis increases his speed and turns to go back down the access road which we came up. The tyres start hitting the rats and I hear popping noises and crunches as they are squashed under the giant wheels. Keep going, I yell, and wait until we're clear of the fuel pumps before opening up with the GPMG. The rats' bodies are small, but there are so many of them that I can't see the road surface now. The heavy calibre machine gun rips through them, sending bodies flying into the air, but for every rat that is torn apart by the machine gun, several more appear. I spin around to face back towards the pumps and see them pouring around the sides of the building, all heading our way. Now thousands of rats with red bloodshot eyes surge towards us, and as we clear the end of the flat roof, I see bodies dropping down onto the top of the Saxon. Fuck! They're on the top! I scream out and feel the Saxon give a burst of speed as Curtis tries to shake them off. Several of them fall off, but a few remain and start walking towards me, rocking with the motion of the vehicle. I can't shoot them, as I don't know if the rounds will penetrate the armoured vehicle from this close range, and the gun won't aim down that low anyway. I open fire on the fuel station and pour rounds into ground level. Bodies get burst apart and blown away, and I see mini explosions of blood as the large bullets rip through their bodies. I keep firing, and the rounds hit the fuel pumps. I aim for the one we were using. As we get onto the access road and are crushing hundreds of rats beneath us, the fuel pump explodes into flames with a massive bang. Thick black smoke billows up and rolls across the flat roof and over the sides. The fuel in the pipes gets set alight, and within seconds, the other pumps are exploding, sending scorched bits of rat bodies past me from the pressure wave. Each pump goes with a massive bang, and a huge fireball erupts upwards, incinerating the flat roof within seconds. The structure collapses from the sudden intense heat, which sends more flames and smoke billowing out the sides. Another huge fireball explodes, and this one is much bigger than the previous. The remains of the roof are launched high into the sky, jagged chunks of metal flying off in different directions. One large chunk is sent wheeling through the air directly at us, and I drop down just as it bounces off the rear and goes spinning over us, landing directly in the path of the Saxon. Curtis slams the brakes on, and we all go flying forward, then off to the side as he steers around the obstacle. There's fucking thousands of them, I shout out above the noise of the engine screaming and the huge explosions behind us. Just as I move back towards the GPMG hole, a big, fat, black rat drops down onto the floor of the Saxon. We all shout and scream and start stamping down with our boots, but the speedy body darts and weaves through us. Another fat body drops down, and now we're trying to stamp down on two of them. Tucker's big boot gets the first one, which explodes under his foot, bits of blood and fur spraying out. Fucking got him! Tucker yells with victory. Get out of the fucker then! Cookie yells as we're trying to stamp down and kick it. The rat is darting about very fast and trying to leap up at our legs, the long yellow teeth bared and gnashing with ferociousness. Yeah, got both of the fuckers! Tucker yells as his massive boot crushes the next one. Don't fuck for that, I fucking hate rats! 
Blowers sinks back onto the bench seat just as several more rats drop down from the hole and start running around the back. Curtis, we have to stop, I shout out as we all dance up and down, stamping our feet. They're everywhere though, Curtis yells back. Head for the services building, fucking quickly too. We all jolt as the Saxon goes in a straight line and speeds up, bouncing over the curbs and lane dividers. We keep jumping and slamming our feet down as a rat jumps onto the front of Darren's trousers and starts climbing up his legs onto his stomach. Blowers punches out hard and strikes the rat in the middle of its body. The rat drops down, but the blow was hard and knocked Darren back onto the benches. Sorry, mate, Blower shouts. It's okay, Darren yells as he gets up, winded but still dancing on the spot. Almost there! Make ready! Dave bellows at the top of his voice, and we all try to pick our assault rifles and bags up as we bounce up and down, black bodies scurrying and jumping at our boots. Brace! Dave yells, too late as Curtis slams the brakes on, bringing the Saxon to a grinding halt. We all go flying, and I drop down onto my hands and knees. A rat launches at my face and is kicked aside by a black boot. Thank you, I shout as I get back up, and we all scrabble to get to the back doors, bursting out onto the concrete just a few feet away from the front doors. Get inside, Dave yells, and we all start running to the doors. Dave gets there first and slams into them and bounces off. Locked, he yells and starts kicking at the doors. I get to his side and glance back to the car park. We've gained a few seconds, but the rats are pouring across the car park. I start hammering on the doors and see someone moving around inside. A man appears running towards the door, but stops when he sees several armed and crazy-looking men yelling at him. Open the doors, Dave shouts, but the man walks a bit further, then stops and stares back at us, a terrified look on his face. Dave steps back and aims his assault rifle directly at the man. I can shoot you faster than you can run. Open the doors now! The man jerks forward and pulls a set of keys out of his pocket and fumbles with a lock. Eventually, he opens the door and we burst in, roughly pushing him aside. We all try to get at the doors at the same time and slam them shut. The keys are still in the lock and I manage to turn them and pull them out just as the rats slam into the glass panes from the other side. We all jump backwards and aim our assault rifles down into the writhing mass. Don't shoot, you'll break the glass! Dave shouts, and we all slowly lower our weapons, watching with horror and disgust as the rats throw themselves at the doors. Several of them stretch their mouths wide open and try to bite at the smooth glass, but all I can see are hundreds and hundreds of pairs of red eyes. We need to seal the building up, I say to the recruits. Team Alpha, take the left side with Dave. Team Bravo, the right side with me. Make sure every door and window is closed and locked. Dave, McKinney, Smith, Tucker and Hewitt all run off to the front left side of the building, straight into the cafe area. To the right is a convenience style shop and I start into it with Blowers, Cookie, Reese and Graves. We sweep around the edge of the building, kicking in doors and shouting clear when we've checked the area. The convenience store has a storeroom and small staff canteen. Both have doors and windows leading to outside, but all are checked and found to be locked securely. We move out of the shop and down the wide central aisle. The next room on the right is a small amusement arcade with darkened fruit machines. I watch the lads quickly sweep the rooms, but the room is sealed internally with no other doors. As they come back out, I hear a woman screaming and see her running out of the restrooms, which are directly ahead of us. There's a rat in the toilet, she screams, and doesn't even take in the armed men walking towards her. I see a Burger King off to the right. A long counter and seating area with tables and chairs with several people all standing up to look at us. There are thousands of rats trying to get inside this building. We need to seal every point of access. I shout at them, scaring them witless, and a woman faints and falls on the floor. A young child starts screaming and is picked up by another adult female. Blowers, you check in there with Cookie. Jamie and Curtis with me to the toilets. Sir, they all shout. I run ahead to the toilets, one wide access in, the males to the right and the females to the left. Jamie, you take the right side, Curtis with me. We split up as Curtis and I burst into the ladies' toilet. 
The first cubicle door is open, and a fat black rat is climbing out of the toilet bowl, using its front paws to pull itself up. I run into the cubicle and slam the lid down hard, crushing the rat dead. I lift the lid and use my foot to push it back inside, then slam the lid down again. I hear Curtis yelling and slamming the lid down in the next cubicle, and I move out and around to the next one after that. I see one rat already on the floor, scrabbling towards me. I take a running kick and splat it against the rear wall. The body hits, slides down and remains motionless on the floor. The next rat drops out of the bowl onto the ground and I stamp down, crushing the wet, shit-smeared body. I move from cubicle to cubicle, pulverising rats as they appear. Curtis, I'll hold these. You find something heavy to put on the lids, I shout to him. I position myself a few feet back so that I can see all of the cubicles and then run forward to crush or kick them as they appear. I'm kept busy as they keep coming until I pick the dirty, wet, dead zombie rat bodies up and throw them into the bowls to try and block them. I keep doing this until each bowl is filled with dead rats, then I put the lids down, but I can still hear them fidgeting and moving about. I push the flush buttons for each bowl, trying to drown any living undead rats that are still down there. Curtis bursts in with blowers and cookie, each of them carrying a heavy, long cylindrical waste bin. We put the heavy metal bins on the lids and step back to see if the rats can get out. After a couple of minutes, I'm satisfied that they can't, so I push the already dead rats out of the way and get the lid up. Burger King's clear, sir, Blowers says. Thanks, mate. What about the men's toilets? I asked Jamie. We did the same thing in there. They were trying to come up through the bowls, too. Okay, let's see if the others are all right. We leave the toilets and make our way into the central area. Dave and Team Alpha are already waiting for us. All clear for the minute, Mr Howie, but it won't last long, Dave says as we join them. Nick has pulled out a packet of cigarettes and the lads start lighting up after Nick looks at me for approval. Crack on, lads. I think we need a few minutes rest after that, I say to them as they light up, taking deep drags. I know what you mean. We always had rats in the supermarket. The fuckers will get through anything for food. This place has air conditioning, so there'll be vents. Also, the drains will need sealing up. Okay, Mr Howie, Dave says. Mr Howie, are those fucking things zombies too? Tucker asks me. They certainly look like it, mate. I don't plan on getting bitten, though, so I cannot be exactly sure, but look at those eyes. Yeah, but why are they coming for us, Mr Howie? Smith asks me, and they all look to me for an answer. I don't know, but it bloody looked like that, didn't it? They were watching us for ages before they started to attack. There's people here they could have come for, but mind you, we were out in the open and they were locked in here. I shake my head, trying to make sense of it all. What a fucking day, I add, and rub my forehead. We're all sweating heavily from the hot weather and the frantic exercise we've just done. I'm parched. They must have some fluids in here. Let's look. I turn and walk, amazed that I've used the word fluids instead of saying drink. Bloody Dave, he's rubbing off on me. Uh, hi, a voice says meekly, and I look up to see the man who unlocked the doors walking slowly out of the entrance to Burger King. Hi, sorry about that, we didn't mean to barge you out of the way like that, I said to him. Cookie, you're on first watch on the front doors, Hewitt, you watch the toilet entrance... We'll bring you some drinks, I say to the lads, and then walk up to the man and extend my hand. Hi, I'm Howie, I say to him, and we shake hands. Tom, I was the night manager when this happened. There's quite a few others in here too, he says, nodding towards Burger King. Are you guys the army? No, mate, these lads had just joined up when Dave and I found them at Salisbury. We were there to take that huge vehicle. So that means you are the army then, Tom says. Well, they're newbies, really, and so am I. Dave is the well-trained one. He was in the army. But you're in charge of them. I guess, but they're just lads, really. We're on our way to London. The man nods at me. You better come and meet the others, he says. And I follow him into Burger King. The lads are already behind the counter, going through cupboards and pulling out bottles of water. Mr Howie, Tucker calls out and throws a bottle of water over as I go past the counter. Cheers, mate. There are about eight or nine adults in here, plus one small child and a baby. They're all clustered around some tables in the middle. 
The people looked very tired and frightened and keep glancing over to the lads behind the counter. I realise how terrified they must feel, seeing us all in full action. I nod at the group. Hi, I'm Howie. Sorry about the noise and bursting in like that, and please excuse the lads, they're just getting a drink. We're not here to hurt anyone, I promise. We're just trying to get away from the thousands of rats that are chasing us. They all start talking at once, and Tom holds his hand up to quieten them. Mark, why don't you go first? Tom says, indicating a man who is still wearing a smart business suit, although the shirt top button is undone and his tie is pulled down slightly. Mark stands up and glances round at the others before speaking. I think I speak for all of us when I ask just what the hell is going on here. He has a strong, cultured voice. What do you mean? I say to him, puzzled at the question. Well, you're not the army. I think we have the right to some answers. We are not the army. I. But you're dressed like soldiers and are carrying military assault rifles, plus you are driving around in a tank, Mark continues. APC, the lads chorus. Yes, I know how it must look. Dave was in the army and we are wearing army clothes as ours were covered in blood. So just who are you and why are you here? Mark demands. I'm Howie. That's Dave over there. I indicate Dave who just stares back blankly. And the other lads are the recruits we met at Salisbury. My sister is in London. I'm going to try and get her, which is why we've got the big vehicle. Didn't any of you hear that broadcast on the radio? They look at each other in confusion, then back to me with eager faces. What broadcast? Has the government released a statement? Mark asks. I don't know about the government, but I heard a broadcast on a car radio. It said that London was infected and for survivors to head to the forts on the south coast. Well, just who put the broadcast out? Who sent it and what else did they say? Mark says, his tone becoming more forceful. I don't know. It didn't say. It was just a looped message on a random frequency. Didn't any of you go through the radio frequencies? Some shake their heads and others just stare back at me, blankly. Don't any of you watch the movies? In horror movies, they go through the radio frequencies and search for government messages. I'm dumbfounded at the amount of people I've met so far that have not bothered to do this. I don't think any of us have scanned the radio, but what's this about rats? We were getting fuel when we saw hundreds of rats staring at us. Now this whole area is covered in them. They've got the same red eyes that the the strange people have. I told you, Mark, that they were coming up through the toilet, the woman who ran screaming earlier says. She too is wearing a smart business suit and has the same cultured tones as Mark. Yes, thank you, Cynthia, Mark says, without even looking at the woman. Listen, we need to secure this building and make sure they can't get in, I say to the group. How will they get in? A woman holding the child asks, her face pale and drawn. Rats can get in anywhere, through air vents, drains, and with so many of them in full force, they can chew through most materials. Oh my God, they'll get in and kill us. They'll kill my babies! She starts panicking, clutching the child closer to her. No, we'll secure the building and figure something out, even if it means just waiting until they go away or die. I turn to Tom. Tom, we need you to explain the layout of the building to us and identify any rat entry points. Okay, now? Tom asks. Yes, mate. Lads, gather round. Now, just wait a minute, I think we were talking, Mark says with a condescending tone. No, mate, I say, cutting him off. We have to do this now before it's too late. We can talk more later. I make a point of turning away from him and looking at Tom. Is there a flat roof? I ask Tom. Yes, it's quite big, actually, he replies. OK, we need to get someone up there. Is there access from inside the building? At the back, there's an access ladder. Jamie, you've got the rifle. I want you up top, but we need a way for you to communicate with us down here. There's a couple of skylights in that central area, sir. We could open them so that Jamie can shout down, Blower says. Tom, will they open without being forced or broken? You just need to undo the latches. This place is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so they're not a security issue, Tom replies. Okay, good idea. Blowers, Jamie... 
Do that then, mate. Crack open one of the skylights and shout down to make sure we can hear you every 20 minutes so we know you're all right. Got it? Yes, sir, Jamie Reese replies. Right, we keep two in the middle area at all times, watching the front and the rear, and then a couple on constant patrol around the building, checking all of the rooms. The rest of us will make the building secure. Tom, does that shop stock sellotape? What? Tom asks. Or brown parcel tape, I say to him. Oh, right, yes they do. We have to get some of our office supplies there, if we run out. Right, okay, if any of you want to help, that'd be great. I look at the group seated in front of me. An old man and woman quietly look at each other. We'd be glad to help you, young man, the elderly chap says. I'll stay here with Mary and help to look after the children, the old woman says, indicating the scared woman clutching the child. A baby in a removable car seat sleeps next to her. Tucker, we need to get moving. While we start getting the building secure, you go through the supplies and see how much food and drink we have. Yes, sir, Tucker responds and shoots off towards the counter. Dave, can you come with me, Jamie and Tom to look at the roof? Yes, Mr Howie. We go through to the back of the building into the utility and office areas. Tom explains that they have daily deliveries, so the only stock will be what's in the shops and cafes. We stop at a metal access ladder that leads up to a small landing in a door. Tom ascends first and unlocks the door with his set of keys. We follow up and step out of the door into the bright sunshine, ready to respond in case the roof is covered with rats. The sides of the building are sheer, and unless the zombie rats start stacking boxes, it will be unlikely that they can get up here. All the wiring and pipes are underground, so there are no attachments to the building anywhere, Tom says, as we walk around the perimeter. The view is much worse than I thought it would be. The ground level is thick with rats stretching out across the car park, all the way back to the still-burning fuel station. At least now we know who caused that, Tom says. Yeah, sorry about that, mate. Bit of a desperate situation. I apologise, watching the thick black smoke pluming up into the sky, sending a massive smoke signal to every undead in the area. We can expect more visitors now, I say to Dave, who nods. The rats are climbing on top of each other at the edges of the building, each one desperately fighting and squirming to get inside. They're on all sides of the building now, and hundreds more are still pouring in from all directions. We get to the central skylight and undo the clasps on the sides. The top can be fully removed, but that would be dangerous. Rats might descend very quickly, like in the Saxon. Just crack it open a few inches so we can slam it down if we need to, I say. Cookie, Nick, can you hear me? I shout down. Two faces appear underneath me, grinning up. Loud and clear, Cookie shouts. I move away a few feet. How about now? I call out. Yep, still good. I move over to the edge of the building and call out again. Yep, we can hear you fine, Cookie shouts up. Okay, Jamie, all yours. Shout down every 20 minutes so we know you're still alive. If I see any of the people, can I fire on them? Jamie asks me. I look to Dave and we both nod. Yes, mate, but let us know first so we don't all jump out of our skins. Okay, Mr Howie. Bugger, he is slowly turning into Dave. Back downstairs, I see that Blowers has already divided them all into teams and sent them off into various sections to secure the building. I told him to tape up every possible entry point, he says. Well done, mate. I watch as Dave walks down the aisles and stops to pick something up from the shelf. Then he walks over to the counter, to a tray of cigarette lighters. He raises a can of hairspray and presses the button as he sparks the cigarette lighter, and a long flame shoots out from the nozzle of the can. He looks over to me and smiles. I knew we'd have flamethrowers at some point, I jokingly groan. Bloody good idea though, mate, let's hand them round to everyone. But they might burn the building down. Maybe we should put them at key points so we can spray into the drain openings and toilet bowls in case they break through. Dave nods in agreement and we start walking through the building, watching the recruits and the people from Burger King taping up every air vent and drain cover. Darren Smith is stretching tape across the gap, just a few inches back from the front door. It won't stop them, but it might buy us a bit of time, sir, he says, as we stop to help. 
Tom, we need a safe, secure place we can all go to in case they get through. The storeroom or the office? The office has the cash safe in there, so it's the most secure, just very small, he replies. Will we all fit in there? I ask him. Probably not, so we could use the office and the storeroom, if we make the storeroom fully secure. They're connected by the corridor, aren't they? I ask him. Yeah, so we could fall back to the storeroom first and then the office if all else fails, Tom replies. We walk through to the back area. The old chap from Burger King is working with McKinney, taping up the air vent. I check the rear access, a double metal door with safety bars on the inside and thick-looking bolts on the top and bottom. We should keep these doors clear. They look strong, and even rats can't chew through metal quickly. I explain the plan to the old man and McKinney, and then work with them to secure the room completely. The door leading into this area from the main building is only a single wooden door. There are some stock cages in the storeroom, and I work with Dave and McKinney to pull the cage off the wooden base. Once free of the wooden base, the metal cage stretches out. It's fine mesh, and we jam it against the door. That should hold them for a bit longer if needed. We remove the mesh barrier and rest it to one side. We hear shouting and run into the main area to see Nick booting a rat against the wall. Coming from the ladies' toilets, he yells. And we run in to see thick black bodies straining to lift the lids with the heavy waste bins on top. The dead rats I put in the bowls have just given them something to stand on and get leverage. I grab a can of deodorant and a lighter and charge into the cubicle. Just as the lid lifts and two of them squirm halfway out, I ignite the spray keeping the button pressed down and push the flamethrowers at the bodies. The rats squeal and start thrashing. The jet of hot flame incinerates their small bodies within seconds. Remarkably, they keep trying to fight their way out rather than dropping back down into the safety of the bowl. I kick out at the flaming bodies and stamp them down onto the floor so that I can crush them underfoot. I rush out and see Dave doing the same thing, but holding the flame directly on their heads so the fur burns away. He scorches them to death amidst squealing and thrashing. We need someone in both toilets all of the time, I shout out as the last of the rats is destroyed by fire and stamping. I'll do these ones, McKinney offers. We go back out into the main area. Cookie and Nick Hewitt are still there, but looking in our direction with concerned faces. All clear for now. Cookie, can you keep watching the men's toilets, mate? Nick, you watch this area and the front doors, I shout over to them. He'll bloody like that, Blower shouts from off to the side somewhere. Cookie likes hanging around in the gents' bogs, don't you, Cookie? He adds, as the lads all start sniggering from their various positions. I even hear Jamie chortling from above us on the roof. Get fuck language, lads, I shout out and cut Cookie off before he offends everyone in the building. Cookie grins and walks off to the toilets. Oi, Nick, you got any more smokes, mate? Cookie yells, and Nick throws him another packet. We keep walking around the inside edge of the building, checking and rechecking the access points. Nearly all of the tape is used up. There's just a few rolls left over. The storeroom is searched, but no more tape is found. I find Tucker in the other cafe, the one by the services company. He's sorting through boxes of food and making piles. Tucker, can you get some supplies into the storeroom and office at the back? There are fallback points, I say to him. Got it, he responds, and starts loading boxes with bottles of water and snacks. Also, mate, in your official capacity of stores man, can you get those first aid kits on sale in the shop and stack them in there too? Get some dressings and stuff to the lads as well, and make sure they've all got water and something to eat. Tucker nods and starts moving off. Oh, and Tucker, he turns back to face me. Sir? Thanks, mate. Good job. He smiles and walks off, and Dave stares at me again. What have I done now? I ask him. Nothing. Nothing at all, Mr Howie. Gonna be a long night, I can bloody feel it. Yes, Mr Howie. It will be. Chapter 34 The rats sat and waited until the numbers were strong enough to attack and be sure of a victory. The infection felt the pull of the rodents as their urge to attack and bite of the resistors was pulling at them. But the infection held them and waited for more to arrive. 
It watched from the thousands of pairs of eyes and picked up on the scent trails from thousands of pairs of noses until sufficient were present. Then, as the one they called Howie got on top of the vehicle, they commenced the attack, pouring across the small fuel station forecourt and throwing themselves at the vehicle. Many died instantly from the giant wheels crushing them, but they still poured in, and the infection knew they would be taken now. The vehicle started moving, but the infection had planned for this, tapping into some of the memories and images from the human hosts and starting to learn basic tactics. It sent rats up onto the roof so they could attack from all directions. As the vehicle rolled under the roof, the infection pushed the bodies over the edge to drop down. Some held on but many were thrown off as the vehicle went faster. And then the one they call Howie used a loud tool to fire metal at the rats and the station exploded. The infection felt many of the rodents scorched and blown to pieces by the massive explosions, but it still sent wave after wave of rats after them. The infection moved the rats from the top of the vehicle and made them drop down into the inside, where it could see and smell the potential hosts but those resistors were quick and the infection failed to send in enough rats to finish them off. It kept the rats moving and leaping at the bodies, but the boots were too thick and the rats' small teeth were unable to penetrate. The resistors were lucky, as they had no idea how many times the rats sank their teeth into the edge of the thick leather boots before being kicked away or stamped upon. The infection watched as one of the rats gained purchase on the front of one and started to climb up to the soft skin of the stomach, but another one struck out and killed it. Then it got more rats inside, and the potential hosts stopped the vehicle and ran into the building. The rats were urged on and whipped into a frenzy, but the resistors got inside the building. The infection sent the rats against the walls and glass and forced them to bite into anything soft enough to damage. It found pipes and access tunnels and sent the rats along and into the toilets, just as it had done so many times before. But the resistors were there again and repelled each attack, killing the rodent hosts. Through the eyes of the rats, the infection saw the huge plume of black smoke rise high into the clear blue sky. Every host across the county stopped and stared into the sky, searching for the sign. The infection saw the thick black smoke through many human host eyes and sent those towards it. But they're too slow, and the shuffling will take them too long. The infection knows that it can speed them up, but they will become weaker and unable to repair the already badly damaged and decaying bodies. The infection calculates this risk and allows more energy to flow the hordes of zombie undead suddenly start forward with renewed speed and they run in staggered groups towards the smoke signal. Chapter 35 We keep pacing around the building, checking and rechecking. More rats escape from the toilet bowls but are quickly dispatched by the flamethrowers used by Cookie and McKinney. They shout to each other with a running tally, competing with the number of kills they both get. Tucker has distributed water and snacks amongst the recruits, and I keep rotating them around so they don't get bored, apart from Cookie and McKinney, who are too intent on their competition to leave their posts. The people that were already here are moving about, chatting with the recruits and making suggestions, until they all gather back in the seating area of Burger King. Dave and I join them, after taking another walkabout and checking each area. How are we going to get out? I asked Dave quietly, away from earshot of the group. They're too small to take on easily, and there are fucking thousands and thousands of them now. Even Dave seems stuck for once and looks thoughtful. Maybe they will die quickly, but we can't risk just waiting here. They'll bite their way through soon enough, mate, I say to him. He doesn't respond, but just looks at me. There must be something we can do to reduce their numbers, or get back inside the Saxon and lock the top down. We'll never get through them, Dave says. Okay, what about fire? But that risks the building and us, too. Or we could try poison. But we don't have buckets of rat poison. I keep making suggestions, negating each one as I think of it. How about electrocution? We did that at the police station. There's no power here, Mr. Howie. I did think about that. Okay, mate. Do you know what we need? I ask him. What? 
an exploding cow. I smile at him. We don't have any cows here, Mr. Howie. I know, it was a joke, Dave. Oh, okay. The grenades would be no good, we're too close to the building, I say thoughtfully. They're still in the Saxon, Dave says. Oh well, there's that idea gone. Contact! Jamie shouts from above us. The people in Burger King all stand up and look about, terrified. Quick, upstairs, I say to Dave, and we run to the access ladder in the back area and climb up onto the roof. What have you got, Jamie? I race towards the front edge where he's standing, aiming the rifle. Look! Jamie points almost dead ahead, and I peer out over the car park to the hordes of undead zombies running towards us. It's not night time, and they're running. Why are they running? I shout out, alarmed. They're coming straight for us, sir, Jamie says. Start shooting them, mate. I run across the roof to check the other sides, and I'm horrified to see more of them coming across the car park. More are on the motorway and even coming across the fields behind the services building. Fuck me, there's loads of them. I check my watch. It's about an hour to sundown, but they're running now. Something has changed. What's going on? A voice shouts up through the skylight. Zombies, coming from all sides and fast, I yell down. But it's daylight, the voice shouts up. That's what I said. Get the others up, quick as you can, but keep Cookie and McKinney in the toilets and Hewitt on the main area beneath us. I move back to the front and see Jamie taking aim and firing at the oncoming masses. His aim is brilliant. Even from this range and firing at moving targets, he still drops them. Are you getting headshots from here? I ask, surprised as they fall down and stay down. No way. Not from this distance and the speed they're moving at, Jamie replies, and fires again with a cough sound from the rifle. But they're staying down. Are they? I haven't looked. Hang on. Jamie says and sweeps the scope back to the ones he has already shot down. You're right. They are staying down, not even moving, he says. They must be weaker. A body shot like that wouldn't stop them. It might drop them down, but they'd keep coming. I make my SA-80 assault rifle ready, just as Tucker, Blowers, Curtis Graves and Darren Smith come out onto the roof, one at a time. Jamie is killing them from this distance with body shots, I say, as I take aim and hear the rest of them rack their rifles and make ready. Spread out to cover all sides, Dave says. I aim at the centre mass of a large, built, undead female who is staggering and wobbling across the car park. I fire and watch her drop as she is struck somewhere in the middle of her body. I keep watching, waiting for her to start twitching and trying to get up, but she remains completely still. I next aim for the middle of a group and fire into them. One of them drops and is instantly trampled under the feet of the others. I hear rifles popping all around me and the coughing noise from the sniper rifle held by Jamie. I keep firing and feel a deep satisfaction as they're dropped on the spot. There are more moving fast, though, and they're already halfway across the car park. The rats pay them no attention, and the zombies just stagger through the black bodies, treading them down or kicking them aside as they lurch forward. Even when the human zombies drop from being shot, the rats don't try and eat them. They just keep surging forward. Shit, look at that lot, Blowers calls out, and I look over. He's facing the motorway, and I see a densely packed horde charging down it towards the slip road. They are really crammed together at the front, and then spread out to a long tail further down the motorway. There's more coming across the fields at the back too, Tucker shouts. They don't like us much, do they? I shout out. Rats and zombies all coming for us, doesn't it just make you feel special? Jamie, can you start dropping them as they come into the access road from the motorway, mate? Sir, Jamie confirms, and moves over to the corner of the building so he can cover the car park entrance to the access road and the motorway. He puts his bag down at his feet, and I see it's full to the brim with boxes of bullets. I move over to the skylight and shout down. Get one of those people up here to help Jamie reload the rifle magazines. I watch Hewitt run towards Burger King, and I go back to the front and take aim. There are hundreds of zombies coming for us now, and thousands of rats. We keep firing, taking single shots, and manage to keep them back from the building but their numbers are huge and it's only a matter of time before they get to us. How can I help, young man? 
I turned to see the old man coming up the ladder and onto the roof. Can you reload a rifle magazine? I asked him. I did national service, so I can't imagine it's changed very much. I might be a bit rusty, but I'm sure I'll soon pick it back up, he says with confidence. Dave, can you show him what to do? We need to keep Jamie firing. Yes, Mr Howie, on it now, Dave responds, and takes the old timer over to Jamie and shows him how to push the bullets into the magazine and stack them up on the low wall next to Jamie. We keep shooting, and they keep dropping, but more are coming, and we still have the rats to deal with. We're getting good results, though, and the car park and surrounding areas are soon littered with bodies. Here they come! The old man shouts as the massive horde from the motorway staggers out of the access road and spreads into the car park, running towards us. I turn and fire into them, as do Dave and Jamie. Our shots are good. Dave stops firing and drops down to the bag at his feet. He pulls out a black pistol and hands it to the old man. Can you use this? he asks. Oh yes, I was a good shot a few years back, he replies, taking the gun and examining it with steady hands. He takes seconds to figure out how to push a magazine in and slide the top back. When they get closer, start using it, Dave says simply, and goes back to firing at the massed horde charging towards us. I keep shooting into them, but the numbers are too high and they are relentless. They get halfway across the car park and the old man raises the pistol and starts firing. Sharp cracks fill the air as the handgun fires and his arm hardly moves from the recoil. He drops several of the undead with his first magazine and starts reloading, checking to make sure Jamie has enough magazines before he continues firing. Despite our constant firing, they reach the front of the building and slam into the glass doors with a loud bang. Tucker, get down and support Nick in case they get through, I shout, and Tucker runs towards the ladder. I switch the assault rifle to fully automatic and lean over to look down at the already packed horde and squirming black bodies jumping up between them. I then press the trigger and watch as they are cut down from the rapid fire, but thirty or so rounds last seconds and I'm reloading and firing again. The old man is leaning over and firing into them too. They're at the sides, Blower shouts. Which side? I yell back as I change magazines. Both, he shouts back, running between the two edges and looking down. I glance at the Saxon and the GPMG sitting dormant on the top, wishing we had it now. At the back too, Smith yells out. How are those doors looking? I yell towards the skylight. They're holding, but they won't last if they keep coming. It sounds like Nick shouting up. Tucker, get those people into the safe area and make Tom keep them there. Yes, sir, Tucker shouts, and again I go back to firing down into the increasing horde. They are staring up at us, pale, drawn, decomposing faces that are rapidly becoming less human in appearance. The bodies pile up as we shoot them, which creates a natural obstacle for the others, but they are frenzied and claw and rake at the bodies to get to the doors. The groaning noises they emit are a lot more aggressive now and they almost sound like they're growling. What's got into them? I shout out as I change magazines again. I don't think they like us very much, Blowers says as he fires his weapon down at the sides. I look up and see more coming along the motorway and from all around. Dave suddenly runs off and slides down the ladder, heading underneath us to the shop. He returns a few minutes later with a basket full of bottles of spirits and a roll of kitchen towels. I'll help with those, the old man says, and starts working with Dave to open the bottles and stuff thickly twisted kitchen rolls in the top of them. Dave steps up to the edge of the building and lights the first one. He waits for it to catch a light and launches it high into the air. It smashes on the ground in the middle of a group charging across the car park. The flammable liquid ignites and flames shoot out as the liquid bursts away. Several of the zombies are set alight instantly and they stagger forward but drop down within a few steps. They really are much weaker now, I yell out as the old man hands Dave a flaming bottle. Dave launches it and again it hits in the middle of a group, bursting into flames that shoot up and ignite the zombies. Dave continues with the deadly cocktails until there is a line of fire across the car park. The undead run straight through it and many are set alight and fall down within a few steps but many more make it through and get to the front of the building. The male toilets are gone, Cookie yells out, 
and I glanced down to see him holding the door shut. Is that because you bummed them all? Blower shouts, and I can't help but burst out laughing. Yes, is that a problem? Cookie yells back. And I snigger as I fire my weapon down into the horde again, blowing heads apart and watching the bits of skull and brain matter fly off. The doors are getting overwhelmed now, and the zombies are already several deep and growing. Dave, drop some straight down on them, we'll have to risk it. The building is metal and glass, so we might be all right. They'll be through there any second. Dave leans over the lip and pulls his arm back. Then he launches a bottle straight down which explodes and bursts into flames, sending smoke straight up at us. Dave grabs another one from the old man who has lit two, and they both lean over and throw them down. The liquid flames up instantly and zombies drop like flies to lie in the flames. The rats squeal and scurry about with more frantic movements, and I see many of their bodies on fire too. Daylight fades and turns to night, as more zombies pour across the car park towards the building. As the last of the light fades, they all suddenly stop and stand perfectly still. Here we go, I mutter under my breath. Mind you, they can't get much worse, can they? They all stare up at the sky and start to roar into the night, just as they have done each dusk so far. We take advantage by shooting many down, firing into them as they roar. I suddenly feel anger building up in me, and I roar back at them. Come on, you fuckers! Dave joins me, and we roar with defiance at these undead things that are refusing to let us be. Blowers and Jamie join in. Even the old man shouts, and I hear the lads underneath me screaming with defiance. The adrenaline courses through my system. You are many, and we are few, but we will kill you. We are righteous, and you are evil, and we will destroy you. We roar at each other, masses of zombies and a small group in a motorway service station, but right here and now, I wouldn't change sides for anything in the world. The undead stop roaring, but we continue. We scream every bad word ever known to us at them. Dave's drill sergeant voice is the loudest of all. I am death and I come for you, he bellows, and it sends a tingle down my spine. I let rip with every ounce of being and scream as they charge. As one, we stop roaring. As one, we lower our weapons and aim. As one, we fire. We cut them down as they charge towards us, weapons on fully automatic now. Jamie has ditched the sniper rifle and has taken up his assault rifle and is firing into them with deadly accuracy. They keep coming and they keep dying as we scorch them and tear them apart with our bullets. Doors! Cookie bellows from underneath us. Move back! I shout, and we start moving back to the ladder and dropping down onto ground level. Are they all in the safe area? I ask Cookie as I move into the main area. Yes, sir. Tucker has taken them and that Tom bloke said he would keep them in there, Cookie answers. Where's Tucker now? I ask him. He's staying with them to make sure they don't lock us out. Bloody good idea. Christ, look at that lot, I say, as I look towards the doors and see a solid press of bodies squished against them. The pressure is so much that the ones at the front are pushed hard against the glass, and I can see the black rat bodies running between their legs and feet. The toilets went then, I asked Cookie. Yeah, we got fucking loads though. The bodies were stacked right up, but just too many of them coming out. The doors are inward opening, though, so they can't push their way out. Who won the competition? McKinney, the bastard, he grins. The rest scale down and come to join us, staring at the doors, when a sudden realisation hits me. Fuck, the roof is probably the safest place. Why don't we get them all up there? At least we can still fight back. I spin round to Dave. Mate, you hold up here with Cookie and McKinney. The rest of you come with me. I run back to the safe area and into the storeroom. Tucker is just inside, closest to the door. They all jump up and stare at me with terrified faces. Change of plan. We need to get everyone on the roof as soon as possible. You have to move now, I say to them. But hang on, we were told to come in here and now we have to go up there. Surely this is safer. Mark in the business suit starts moaning. Shut up! We need to get moving now! Quickly, get those children up first! 
I run forward and snatch up the baby and start moving back towards the ladder. I make Smith go up ahead of me, and I climb up one-handed, holding the baby with the other arm, while the mother screams and chases me, holding the other child. I pass the baby up to Smith, who takes it, like it's a bomb about to go off. Quickly, pass me that child now, I say to the woman. No, don't take my baby, she screams in blind panic. I drop down and push her to the ladder and force her up the first few rungs. She climbs up, clutching the child. I force them up quickly, apart from the old woman, who, due to her age, takes a little longer. Mark is right behind her and goes to push her up faster, causing her to slip down. Fucking hurry up or we'll all die, you old cow, Mark shouts at her. Blowers steps in quickly and punches him hard to the side of the head, causing him to smack against the wall and slide down. Blowers then stands over him, watching him intently. The rest of you get up quickly. This man and I will wait till last, Blowers says through gritted teeth. Mark stares at him with a look of horror on his face, but stays down on the floor. Doors are going, Dave shouts from the main area. Blowers, get up there quickly, and you, I shout to Blowers and point at Mark, the last ones to go up. I run back to the internal wooden door leading out into the main area and see the glass doors slowly buckling inwards, the glass cracking noisily as the pressure builds. Get back to the ladder and up to the roof now, I shout, and Cookie and McKinney sprint past me. Dave and I kneel down, just a few feet from the internal door leading to the back area and the ladder. You next, Dave. No, Dave states. Fine then, we'll both stay here, I say stubbornly and we both raise our rifles and take aim at the doors. Are you going or what? I say after a few seconds. Nope, he answers. Okay, be like that. I will, Mr Howie. We watch both the doors, both of us being unwilling to be the first to break away. They'll be through those doors any second now, Dave. Yes, so you'd better get going then. You really should go, Mr Howie, I'll cover... The glass fractures and doors start buckling further open. I glance over to him and he looks back at me as I grin. He smiles slowly back at me. Ready, Dave? I ask him, turning back to the doors. Yes, Mr Howie. The doors burst open and the zombies start pouring in. We open fire on fully automatic, cutting them down in droves and sending them back to hell. They surge forward. Zombie men, zombie women and zombie rats. Just as they reach us, I lean over and slam the wooden door closed and brace it with my back. I've got the door, you go now, I shout at Dave, pushing against the door next to me. Dave, I've got the door, get up that ladder now. I've got the door, Mr Howie, you go. I got to the door first, so it's mine, I shout back at him over the thumps and bangs. No, Mr Howie, he grunts, straining at the door. Right, I didn't want to have to do this, but you said I was in charge. He shoots a look at me. So, if I'm in charge, then I'm ordering you to get up that ladder. He stares at me for a moment, then... Okay, Mr Howie, move quick, though. The door won't hold. I know, mate, now go, I shout. He releases suddenly and sprints to the ladder and starts climbing up fast. As soon as he gets halfway up, he shouts down, Now! Coming! I shout back and jump away from the door and start sprinting towards the ladder. The doors burst open behind me and I hear them charging into the room. During those milliseconds of running, I work out that if I grab that ladder, they will be on me before I can climb up. Dave or anyone else up there won't be able to shoot down because I'll be in the way. Dave will most likely drop down and try to fight them all and get killed in the process and Dave is the strongest chance they all have for survival. All it will take is one bite or scratch and I'm done for. And they are moving fast now. There is no way I can go for the ladder. It just can't be done. Time slows down as I reach my hand out to grab it, then pull my arm back at the last second. I race forward into the storeroom, slamming the door behind me. I lock the door and push the bolts in at the top and bottom as I hear Dave bellowing my name and the growling of the zombies as they impact on the other side of the door. The door is solid wood and will hold for a bit. Plus, the door isn't that wide, so they won't be able to get that many bodies across it. But they can press in from behind, and eventually the door will go. 
I pull the opened cage sides down across the door and pile boxes and items in front of it. Sweating and breathing hard, I step back and look round. Tucker has left some supplies down here, and I smile as I realise that even during those frantic few minutes, he managed to get some of the supplies up onto the roof. I sink down onto the top of some boxes and change magazines and the assault rifle. Next, I pick up a bottle of water and take a long drink before I settle down to listen to them thrashing against the door trying to get to me. I hear muffled shots. The lads must be shooting down onto the horde below. I feel numb, and suddenly very alone. I know that if I'd gone for the ladder, I would never have made it, but already there is doubt in my mind that maybe I could have gone for it. But they were right behind me and I only just managed to get this door closed. One bite, that's all it takes. Chapter 36 Dave screams as Howie runs past the bottom of the ladder. He is at the top, aiming down with his rifle, ready to drop them as Howie climbs. But he went straight past and into the storeroom. Dave hears the door slam shut and his mind calculates that Howie got into the room safely. Mr. Howie! he bellows and then listens. Mr. Howie! he roars again. Still nothing. Get on those sides and kill them! Dave turns away from the ladder and storms over to the front of the building. The people from Burger King are huddled in the middle of the roof, cowering down while the recruits and the old man fire down into the massed undead. Smith, watch that ladder! Dave bellows and starts firing down into the crowd. Howie told him he was in charge and had to go. In Dave's mind, things are black and white, right or wrong. There are leaders and there are followers. Even at the supermarket, Dave admired Howie as he reminded him strongly of some of the best officers he had served under. Hard-working, kind and considerate, but also not a fool. He was always willing to make conversation and show a genuine interest in his staff. These traits are rare in an officer, and Dave admired Howie for them. Dave knew he had been without purpose when they attacked the supermarket that night. He'd fallen back on his years of training and natural instincts to protect the base, to protect the place that recruited and paid him. Then Howie showed up, and instead of panicking or screaming, he showed those traits even more. He'd stood next to Dave when they started to attack again. Over the last few days, Howie has shown what a natural and strong leader he is, sticking to the primary objective, but being flexible enough to adapt and overcome whatever is in his path. Doing the right thing at the right time, and doing something that the army had never done with him. Howie encouraged Dave to be human, to joke and to smile, and during that first battle when they charged the zombies in Burrafair town centre, Howie didn't allow the anger to control him. He channeled it and made it work for him. He was clumsy and took unnecessary risks, but Dave could see the battle lust in his eyes and knew that Howie was a man to follow. Since then, Dave had protected Howie. Howie took the recruits and showed them kindness and respect, and by doing so, he became their natural leader too. He protected them during the battle to get the Saxon and knew how to get them safe before the night came. And even after that, when most men would weep or break down, Howie took the time to check on the recruits' welfare and make sure they were all okay, then joked with Dave. Dave knows those are very special traits. He's been in countless war zones and in countless operations and can see when someone is good. Howie is good. Howie is his friend and his leader. To Dave, killing is a skill that comes naturally. He doesn't relish it or dream of it. Killing is just something he is able to do easily. He's small and can move quickly, and is able to coordinate his movements to achieve maximum efficiency. Only with Howie has he felt that bloodlust, that feeling of fighting alongside a fellow warrior and defeating something evil. Dave begins to feel something he very rarely feels, and it's inside, growing and gnawing at him. The assault rifle in his hands becomes something weird and strange, something that doesn't belong to him, and he stops firing and lowers the weapon down gently, then stands still to examine this feeling inside him, trying to block it out. But it pushes up inside of him and tries to take over his mind and body. Dave blocks it and tries to focus, but it screams inside of him. It demands to be released, and it will never go away until it is let out. Blowers! Dave roars, 
his voice rising above all the noise and weapons firing. You're in charge! Dave lets the feeling out. He releases it to purge into his bloodstream and pump around his heart. He closes his eyes as the pressure builds and threatens to overwhelm him. Then the feeling is in control of him, and he opens his eyes and draws his knives, one in each hand, with the back of the blade pressing up against his forearms. Dave looks down into the horde and leaps from the building, straight into the middle of them, as that feeling takes over completely. That feeling is anger. Dave is angry. Chapter 37 I sit in the storeroom, feeling sorry for myself, sorry that I'm separated from the others. Then I think of Dave. He has the address book in his bag, and I know nothing will stop him from finishing what we set out to complete. I feel bad for ordering Dave away from the door like that, but he is a special man, and the recruits need him more than they need me. I can laugh and joke with them, but it's Dave that has given them the skills to survive, and he can carry on showing them and protecting them. Under Dave's tutelage, the recruits will prevail, and I know my sister is in good hands with them too. They will fight together or die together, and they have already shown the commitment and camaraderie they have built up. I feel proud to have fought with them, and I feel especially proud to have fought alongside Dave. I know he struggles with day-to-day -day living, and is unable to see irony or sarcasm, and cannot work out the things people mean when they say something different. But then I think back to some of the little quips he has made, and it shows that even under the most extreme event known to mankind, people can still evolve. The building is surrounded by rats and zombies, and they all want to kill us. The lads can fight them off for a while up there, but they've proven they can wait longer than we can fire, and there seems to be an endless supply of them. But the rats and zombies are trying to get into the building, and are all facing inwards, not the other way. I get to my feet, my blood starting to pound in my ears. My sister stands the best chance of survival if Dave can get to her. Those recruits stand the best chance of survival if Dave takes them. And those survivors we found here stand the best chance of survival if Dave is alive to lead the recruits. If I can get to that GPMG, I can even the odds. And even if a rat or a zombie bites me, the infection won't be instant. I can still fight through or lead them away. It's a chance worth taking, for Sarah, for the recruits, and for those people. Dave must survive, and if that means I charge out to my certain death, then I will do it. I've been lucky so far, and I admit to myself that is mostly down to Dave, and if he could keep a clumsy fool like me alive, he'll be able to do it for them. I draw the long bayonet from the scabbard on my belt and fix it to the end of the rifle, wishing I had my axe with me. One magazine in the rifle, and then the knife on the end, and that's it to get me to the Saxon. Fuck it. I do this for Sarah, for the recruits, and for Dave. And I kick open the rear doors and burst out to find a whole load of nasty zombies on both sides. The door had swung hard and knocked two of them off their feet. I run forward as they immediately turn and start chasing me. I out-sprint them and run down the back of the building and see more of them pressing into the sides of the building. I run out and away from the building and into the car park, then turn and drop down on one knee and fire the assault rifle into the zombies closest to me. They drop down from each shot, and I thank the Lord for whatever has made them weaker. I run on as more of them start running after me, and I see more turning away from the building, coming towards me. I turn right and start towards the front of the building, the rage and anger building inside me. I get to the corner and see the Saxon immobile a few feet from the building. Hordes of zombies are facing away from it, towards the front, and surging into the open doors of the services building. I run forward, desperately trying to reach the Saxon before they see me. But the ones chasing me must send some signal or make noise because they turn and start towards me. I drop down and fire the remains of my magazine into them, tearing them apart and watching them fall and get blown backwards. Out of bullets, I start charging towards the Saxon, roaring with anger. The top of the roof at the front of the building lights up with sustained firing, the bright muzzle flashes startling against the night sky. The recruits shoot down at the zombies as they run towards me, and I know I've been given a chance now, and I take it, sprinting flat out to reach the Saxon. 
Rats are scurrying around my feet and I feel bodies being crushed and kicked as I sprint over them. I reach the Saxon and race around the front to climb into the open driver's door, but there are zombies waiting for me. I charge into them as they come for me and slam the butt of the gun into the closest face. I whip around and thrust the bayonet through the throat of the next one, as I catch a glimpse of my axe handle poking out from the edge of the Saxon. I kick the zombie away, leaving the bayonet and rifle stuck in his neck, and reach out to grab the handle. My hand closes around the shaft and I draw it towards me like an old friend. I step back with my axe, my faithful and trusty axe. I know that if I try to climb in now, they will be on me, so I step to meet their charge and swipe the axe into them. The heavy blade bites into flesh and sends them slamming into the side of the vehicle. I pull back and use the blunt end to knock the next one down, and I keep going and smashing them aside as they charge at me. Suddenly, there's a gap, and I quickly climb into the Saxon and slam the door closed. I dive over the back of the driver's seat and into the back. The rear doors are open, and an undead appears and starts clambering in with his teeth bared. I step forward and lash out with my boot, connecting to his face and pulverizing his nose. Another one charges towards me, and I slam the axe down on his head, breaking his skull open. I overextend and fall out of the back doors and onto the ground. A zombie is inches away from me, bending forward as he lunges for the bite. I press backwards, up against the open rear door of the Saxon, and realize I have nowhere to go. The zombie's head then bursts apart from a round fired from an assault rifle held by someone on the roof. That had to be either Dave or Jamie firing. Either that, or one of them's trying to kill me. I clamber back inside the Saxon, pull the doors closed, and move towards the ladder that leads up to the GPMG. A fat black rat drops down as I look up. Just fuck off, I scream and pick the thing up with my bare hands and launch it hard against the metal rear doors, the body exploding on impact. I climb up and see another rat on top of the machine gun and punch it full in the face, sending it flying off the side of the Saxon. I rack the bolt back and spin around to the front of the building and the huge horde of undead zombies charges towards me. My face splits into a grin as I pull the trigger. Chapter 38 Dave drops down into the horde, using their bodies to break his fall, and instantly he's up and spinning about. The absolute anger and rage burns through him, makes him fight faster than he ever has done before. His arms spin and his legs kick out as he drags the deadly sharp blades across throats and slices open the arteries. He pushes forward, using the knives to puncture the backs of zombies too slow to turn, and plunges the knives into their necks. With amazing athleticism, Dave cuts through the horde, slicing them apart and tearing flesh open with each precise sweep of the blades. He roars into the night and they charge at him. He spins and ducks and leaps through them, killing them swiftly and dispatching them with gruesome finality. Two of them charge at him, and Dave drops his upper body down but raises the knives high and wide and pushes through the middle of them, slicing their necks open as he pulls the blades past him. He pulls his arms forward and thrusts the point through the necks of the next two, dropping them instantly, and he keeps driving forward, killing anything in his path. The anger and the desperation to rescue Howie overwhelms and consumes him. The perfect killing machine, trained only to destroy with ruthless efficiency, allows the rage to spur him on, and those skills become more deadly than ever before. Dave fights his way into the building and down the main area, working his way through countless zombies. The bodies drop behind him as he whirls and dances through them. Fighting and killing to get to Howie. Fighting and killing to rescue his leader and his friend. Dave reaches the door and pushes against it hard, bellowing out, Mr. Howie! The door is locked and barricaded, and he hammers on it with brutal strength as more zombies enter into the main area behind him. Blowers drops down from the ladder and fires into the oncoming undead, then joins Dave in beating at the door. Between them, they force the door open and push the barricade away, bursting into the room to find Mr. Howie gone and the rear doors wide open. 
They charge out into the night and continue fighting their way around to the front of the building. Dave uses his knives to rip them apart and Blowers uses his bayonet and butt of the rifle to cut, slice and slam them down. Rats pour out after them and jump at their legs as they fight and keep moving. Both of them roaring and growling with ferocity and fury. Just as they reach the corner of the building, the GPMG starts firing and they both turn and run out to the car park, then duck down to get to the side of the Saxon. Mr Howie is on the heavy machine gun, firing into the front of the building and cutting down anything that moves. Chapter 39 I keep firing and tearing them apart. For each one I kill, I know that I give the others a fighting chance for survival. My mind is blazing at the destruction I'm causing before me as the bodies are ripped apart, brains and heads bursting apart and limbs being taken off. Blood, bone and bits of body fly everywhere and even the rats are squirming to get away from the deadly hail of bullets. I hear shouting and turn to look down at Dave and Blowers crouching by the side of the Saxon. I grin down at them and wave for them to climb in and watch as they pull the driver's door open and disappear inside. I turn around and aim towards more undead that are coming into the car park from the access road, and together with the recruits firing from the top of the roof, we slaughter them all. Magazine! I yell as the GPMG clicks empty. Let me do it! Dave yells from below me, and I drop down, grinning at him stupidly as I reach the bottom. He grins back and there is a look of relief on his face as he stares at me. Where did you two come from? I ask them. Dave jumped off the building and killed them all to get back inside, Blowers says. Fuck me, bloody hell mate, I would have stayed there with my feet up if I'd known that. Good to see you Mr Howie, Dave says as he climbs up to change the ammunition box on the GPMG. You too mate, and you Blowers, did you leap off the roof too? No, I came down the ladder like a normal person, he says grinning at me. I'll take over, Dave shouts down and the machine gun starts up again. I tap him on the leg to get his attention and he stops firing. Is the front clear? Me and Blowers will make a run for the ladder and get back on the roof. Are you okay here, Dave? Yep, all clear. I'll be alright here, he shouts and starts firing again. We open the doors and climb out, slamming them shut again as we run towards the front of the building. Jumping, clambering and slipping on all of the broken and mashed up bodies, the rats are still running about, but they seem less directed now and slower. Many of them are dead. We get to the ladder and climb up onto the roof. The recruits are all waiting for us, smiling and cheering as we come up to them. Well done, lads. I think we got most of them now, I say to them. We? You did most of it, sir. How did you get to the Saxon? Tucker gushes, his face red and sweating as he hands me and Blowers a bottle of water each. Ah, oh, you know, just sort of legged it and hoped for the best. Jamie, was it you who shot that zombie that was about to bite me? Yes, sir, he says. Bloody good shot, mate. Well done. You saved my life. He blushes as the lads pat him on the back. How's it looking now? I ask them and walk around the sides of the roof, looking down. We got nearly all of them, Cookie says. Just a few left to get, and the rats, of course. Looking down from the roof... I'm amazed at the huge amounts of torn and broken bodies lying about covered in blood. The front is a mess, corpses everywhere. I look over and see Dave scanning around with a machine gun, looking for something to kill. Jamie has got the sniper rifle back and is also sweeping the whole area, the rifle giving little coughs as he fires into the night. Within a few minutes, we're relaxing with bottles of drink and munching on chocolate bars as the lads regale each other with how many kills they got. I walk over to the central area, to the group we found in Burger King. Everyone okay? I ask them. Tom stands up and looks at me. So you got them all? He asks. Yep, pretty much. The rats are still down there, but they're getting slower and some of them are just dying where they stand. If they keep going like that, they should all be dead by sunup and we can get rid of any that remain. So, what happens now? Tom asks me. The others all look over. Now? Well, we rest here for the night and move out in the morning, I guess. What about us? We've lost our safety, he says, looking down at the ground. 
I get the impression he has been forced to speak like this and is feeling ashamed. You weren't safe here for long. It was only a matter of time before they found you, or before looters came for what was left inside. When daylight comes, you should find vehicles and head for the forts. Stick together and avoid the towns and cities, and you'll be okay. He nods and turns back to the group, and they start discussing things with lowered voices. I walk away, feeling like I'm intruding on their discussion. You stay in there, Dave, I shout down to him. Yes, Mr Howie, for a bit anyway. Okay, mate, we'll get someone down to take over in a bit. I arrange for the lads to take shifts, and I do the first one. Walking slowly around the edge of the roof and peering out into the darkness, I can't believe we came through this again. The odds were overwhelming, but we stuck together and backed each other up. I feel shocked, but humbled that Dave leapt off the roof to try and rescue me, while I was charging out into a horde that size to try and keep him alive. We really must coordinate our heroic efforts next time, or this bunch could have ended up with neither of us. We only made a few miles again today, but tomorrow is a new day. We have a full tank of fuel and a straight road into London. What can possibly go wrong? Chapter 40 If the infection had feelings, it would be feeling hurt and humiliated now. It sent wave after wave of rats against them, and then many human hosts too. But the infection pushed them all too hard and weakened them. The energy needed to drive the bodies on like that during the day meant it couldn't work fast enough to prevent the injuries from shutting the bodies down. The rats slowly stop charging about as their bodies decay from within at a rate faster than the infection can fix. They slow down, becoming harder to control, until they simply drop down and die again. The infection watched the one called Howie and the smaller one killing the hosts again and again. The infection was sure it had them when the front doors were forced, but yet again their cunning and guile kept them safe. But the infection learns and evolves, and tomorrow is another day. Another day to find and take over this group of resistors. What can possibly go wrong? Day 6 Wednesday Chapter 41 The sun rises and promises yet another scorching day. The humidity has been high all during the night, and the people on the flat roof of the services on the motorway between Salisbury and London have had a broken sleep, twitching and crying out from the horrors they have witnessed and the fear they have faced. They sweat heavily and slowly strip down to the barest of clothes, just enough to cover their modesty, but they're still desperate to be rid of the restrictive and sweat-soaked clothing. There is no breeze, and as they lie down below the low wall running around the edge of the flat roof, they feel the pressing heat even more. Throughout the night, they get up and move about, breathing heavily and longing for air conditioning. They are listless and lethargic, and any conversations are held quietly and are restricted to the minimum amount of words possible. Those people on the roof each think of the lives they once had, of the things they did, and how they took so much for granted, getting bogged down in the mundane existence of day-to-day -day living, dreaming of better cars, bigger houses, more money, better phones and computers. Convincing themselves that this is what life is about, achieving and getting more things that will make them happy. Not one of those people now wishes they had more time to get the latest iPhone or had a chance to drive a Ferrari. Even the previous excited dreams of winning the lottery now feel unimportant. They all dream and wish they had spent more time with their families, had taken more effort to tell their loved ones how much they loved them. Petty family squabbles that seemed so important at the time now feel stupid and as petty as they really were. Lives full of regret and remorse, dreams unaccomplished and hopes taken away, all for something they played no part in and had no concept of. This living nightmare is a thing of movies and stories too far-fetched to have ever been taken seriously. Soft living in safe places have made most people unfamiliar with the struggles of life that many of their fellow humans suffer. War, disease and poverty had never really affected any of these people on the flat roof. But now the conditions they survive under are so extreme they feel sorry for themselves. And nearly all of them 
point the finger of blame elsewhere. The government, fanatics, crazy people did this. Why weren't more control measures put in place? Why didn't someone do something and stop this? The need to blame someone almost overwhelms some of them, and they fail to realise the time for blame has gone. There is no structure left and no authorities to call up or email and demand answers from. There will not be any parliamentary inquiry or difficult questions raised at the next session of the Prime Minister's questions. This has happened, and the only thing that matters now is survival. Those clinging on to their past lives and waiting for the horror to end are living in denial and will quickly perish simply for not facing reality and taking the necessary steps for survival. Food, water, warmth and security, nothing else matters now and any hope that life will soon return to normal is false. Tucker grows into his role of welfare and supplies coordinator and ambling around the various sweaty bodies distributes bottles of water and urges them to drink and stave off any risk of dehydration. Jamie Reese periodically sweeps the area through the scope of the sniper rifle, taking his time to drop undead latecomers that appear, staggering towards the building. The suppressor on the rifle gives a polite cough and causes no reaction from those scattered about. Simon Blowers and Alex Cookie Cook spend a short time chatting and verbally abusing one another before falling silent and drifting off to sleep. Nicholas Hewitt chain-smokes cigarettes while lying on his back staring at the stars. Darren Smith leans against the edge of the lookout hole in the Saxon armoured personnel carrier, slowly circling around to check the perimeter. Curtis Graves sleeps a few inches away on top of the vehicle. Roland McKinney sits closest to the group of survivors they found in the services, playing marbles quietly with the young child. The mother sleeps fitfully nearby, her hand resting on the car seat within which her baby sleeps. Finally, out in the wide car park which stretches round the front, sides and rear of the services, two men stand and stare at the smoking remains of the fuel station they blew up just a few hours before. That's got to beat the exploding cow. Howie says. It does, Mr Howie, Dave replies. Have you ever taken out a fuel station before then? Howie asks, and Dave stops to ponder the question. Not a fuel station, no, Dave answers. You say that like you've done something similar, Howie says. A refinery. No way, you blew up a refinery. Yes, bloody hell, but that was big. Yes, how did you do that? Again, Dave ponders the question and looks at Howie before finally answering. It's not that hard, really. There are pressurised gas and oil pipes everywhere, and this one didn't have decent fail-safes and safety measures that most should have, so a few explosives and the rest went naturally. I bet that was a big bang. Yes, we were told afterwards that it was seen from space. No way. That must have been massive. How did they know where to look? Who? The astronauts. What astronauts? The ones in space that saw the explosion. It was an imaging satellite. Oh, well, that's still impressive. Howie looks back towards the services building and wipes the sweat from his forehead. That's a lot of bodies, he says. It is, Mr Howie. Must be the biggest amount we've killed yet. Salisbury was a lot, Dave replies. True. Maybe about even, then. Mind you, if we had the rats, too, then this is the biggest yet. Yes. Those rats didn't last long, did they? No, Mr Howie. Why did they start dying off? And the zombies that came for us were much weaker than we've known before. Most of them were dropping from one shot. Do you know, mate, it felt like they were coming for us, like it was for us specifically, like we were targeted. Could be. We have killed a lot of them. Do you think that's it? We've angered them somehow with the amount we've killed. Could be. It's basic strategy to take out your strongest enemy. Is that what we are now? An enemy? Bloody hell, we're just trying to survive. Not really, Mr Howie. Those people are trying to survive. Dave points up to the top of the service's roof. So what, because we've attacked a few of them, they're going for us now? It's a bit more than a few, Mr Howie. True. Yeah, maybe we have pissed them off. We have killed a shitload of them. Howie laughs. I think that's most likely, Dave nods, giving one of his rare smiles. Been bloody good fun, though, 
seems that every half hour something happens and we just react normally. By killing them, Dave answers. Yeah, by killing them, by killing all of them. It's a normal reaction, isn't it? Howie says, still laughing. I don't think so, Mr. Howie. I think most people have run away and hidden. Well, we don't really have that option, do we, mate? No. London will be far worse, especially if they're targeting us. There could be hundreds of thousands or even millions. Bloody hell, when you think of it like that, it's quite scary. Only quite scary? Dave asks. Well, maybe a little bit more than quite scary, but nowhere near full terror. I'm not scared of these fuckers. I hate them. Howie's voice hardens and his face takes on a determined look. Fear is healthy. It keeps you alive, Dave offers. Yeah, I guess so. But I still fucking hate them. No, hate isn't strong enough. It's more than hate, but I don't know what to call it. I wonder what it's like, Howie continues after a few seconds of silence. What? Dave asks. Do they have memories or thought processes? Do they know what's happening to them? Maybe they're trapped inside the body, like when you hear about people going through surgical procedures and being awake the whole time. Maybe they're like that, aware and conscious, but just not in control. So who's controlling them? Whatever the virus or infection is, it's a horrible thought. Being aware of what you're doing and not being able to stop it. It can't be that. Surely they would give some sign. You said that one of them spoke your name on the planes that night. I forgot about that. None of these did it, though, so I must have been mistaken. Ah, they ain't aware of anything, nasty fuckers. But that change last night is still worrying. It's good if they get weaker, it'll make them easier to kill, but not so good if they all start chasing us about during the day, too. No, Dave agrees. Bloody hell, it's hot already. I've never known it to be so hot and humid. Howie moans as he wipes yet more sweat from his forehead. It is unusual. I've got a headache coming. I only get them before a storm, though. But that sky is as clear as anything. We'd better get back on the road. No doubt something else will happen before we get a mile, though. Howie and Dave walk slowly back towards the service building, stepping over the many bodies of zombie people and zombie rats. Towards the front, the bodies are packed so deep they have no choice but to step on them, and their boots sink into the soft, torn flesh, coating their feet in sticky gore. They climb the ladder and reach the roof. Most of the people are already awake from the oppressive heat. Tom, the manager in charge of the services building, approaches them as they walk across the roof. Going to be another hot one, then, Tom says. Scorcher. Feels oppressive, though, like a storm's coming, Howie answers. Could be. It might break the heat a little, Tom says. I don't know if that's a good thing. It might give them some refreshment, too, Howie says. So I guess you lot will be off soon, then, Tom asks. Howie nods. What about all of you? Are you going to head for the forts? He asks. Yeah, I think so. Well, we can't really stay here now, can we? Tom says with a reproachful tone. Tom, you weren't safe here. They would have come eventually, and like I said before, if not them, then looters would have come, Howie answers him. Well, we did okay for quite a while before you lot came, Tom says. Since Friday, Tom. You hid since Friday. What's that, a few days? How long do you think you would have lasted? We had food and drink, Tom responds. Yeah, and how long before someone else wanted it, or the fuel that we took? This isn't going to go away. This isn't a temporary glitch. Everywhere we've been, it just looks worse and worse. There's no police, no army, no government. It's all gone. This was safe for a few days, but believe me, after the things I've seen, you wouldn't have lasted a week here. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe not. It doesn't matter now, does it? We have no choice, Tom says bitterly which adds to the frustration Howie already feels. I think they've done a sterling job. The old man that helped them fight off the hordes of undead during the night stands and speaks, loud enough for them all to hear. I saw them last night, how fast they moved and the way they attacked. And those rats, we wouldn't have stood a chance without these boys. We owe our lives to them. 
The old man stands proud and looks to the group gathered around him. They wouldn't have come if it wasn't for them, Mark says, still dressed in his business suit, but now sporting a bruised face thanks to the punch he got from blowers during the evening for trying to manhandle the old man's wife out of the way of the ladder. Claptrap! Utter claptrap and you know it, the old man barks at him with a sudden ferocity. You are soft and have no idea what war is like. I've served my country and those things are like nothing I've ever seen before. They would have come and they would have killed every one of us. Me, you, and the children. The old man storms at them. The children's mother clasps the children to her tightly at the mention of a threat. We need to toughen up and get with it to survive this thing. Where were you last night, Mark, when they were attacking? I'll tell you, you were cowering at the back while the big boys did the dirty work for you. I'm an old man and I was up there with them. And very glad we were too, Howie interjects. He's right, though. You need to toughen up and get a grip on reality. This is not going away. The quicker you accept it, the greater chance for survival you will have, Howie finishes. Great speech, well done, Mark says sarcastically, rising to his feet and clapping his hands together slowly. It's the truth. You've been holed up here and you've done well to survive this long, but this place is a beacon to anyone moving along that road, and they will come here to find supplies. They might be nice and it could be a good thing, or they might not, and they could take what they want. Anything they want, Howie says, his voice rising. Oh, so the heroes come and rescue us from the bad men, destroy our safety, and then piss off to leave us to rot. Thanks very much. Thanks for nothing, Mark retorts with a condescending sneer. Now you stop that, do you hear me? The old man shouts at Mark. These boys risked their lives last night. That man jumped off this roof to fight them, pointing at Dave. This man fought through all of them to get to that machine gun, the old man points to Howie. If they hadn't risked their lives and fought so bravely while you cowered at the back, then we wouldn't be having this conversation, because we would all be dead, or worse, we would be one of those things. Oh, piss off, old man. Did it remind you of your service days? Mark shouts, and the old man lashes out and punches him hard to the same side of the face that blowers had struck the night before. Mark falls back, but stays on his feet. He rubs his head and steps towards the old man with an angry look on his face. Then stops as eight armed teenage lads and Dave all step forward at the same time. Mark stops and looks around him. They won't be here to protect you all the time, you old bastard, Mark shouts with venom. Dave lunges forward, drawing a handgun from his waistband and slams the hard metal into Mark's face. He drops to the floor. Dave kicks him hard in the face, forcing Mark onto his back. Then Dave leans down and drags Mark by his hair over to the edge of the roof and pulls him onto the top of the low wall. Mark waves his arms desperately and screams loudly as Dave pushes him closer to the edge, forcing his upper body over the lip. If you touch him, I will come for you and I will kill you! Dave bellows into his face as he pushes the end of the pistol into his mouth. Do you understand? Mark squirms and thrashes about until Dave pistol whips him across the face and Mark's nose explodes in a shower of blood. Do you understand? Dave shouts again. Yes, yes, I promise, Mark wails. Dave pulls him up and then shoves him hard back towards the group. Mark staggers and puts his head down as he regains his posture, then looks up and realises that most of the people are staring at Dave. Mark passes the old man and gives him a very quick, hard stare. I saw that, Blowers shouts and starts towards Mark. Wait, what did you see? Howie asks. He gave the old chap a look. Blowers stops and stares hard at Mark. A look? What are you on about? I was just watching where I was going, Mark protests. Howie shakes his head, staring hard at Mark. No, mate, Howie says softly. I think we all know what will happen if we leave you with this group. You're a bully and a coward. Silence descends on the group as they all watch Mark. Even the other woman, dressed in a business suit and clearly with Mark, just stares at him and slowly shakes her head. 
I think Mark will be staying behind, seeing as he likes this place so much, Howie says clearly for them all to hear. You can't do that, Mark shouts in alarm. Watch me. Blowers, you're on him. I'll leave it to your discretion if he causes any problems. Yes, sir. With pleasure, Blowers says and steps very close to Mark, staring hard into his eyes and nodding just once with a nasty smile. No, just wait. Mark starts to plead and Blowers slaps him across the face with an open hand. Mark puts his hand to his face and stares back in alarm. No, just hang on. Blowers strikes him again, harder. Don't just get harder, mate, Blowers says. Please, keep going. I want to hit you. Blowers smiles at him sweetly, and Mark backs away and looks to the rest of the group. They all look away and start preparing to leave. But, hey! Blowers slaps him again. Just fucking stop that, Mark shouts, and Blowers punches him with a clenched fist. Okay, mate, is that any better? Blowers asks as Mark drops down to the ground. The group busy themselves and slowly make their way down the ladder and out to the car park. Cookie and Nick Hewitt join Blowers in watching Mark, all of them standing expressionlessly over the prone figure in the business suit. So, what business are you in? Cookie asks after several long and uncomfortable minutes. What? Mark stammers. What business are you in? Cookie repeats. Banking, Mark replies. Ah, what kind of banking? Cookie says. What? Mark rubs his sore face, not taking in what is being said to him. I said, what kind of banking? Cookie asks again. Why, do you know about banking? Mark says. I'm in hedge funds, actually, Cookie states. Hedge funds? What the fuck are they? asks Hewitt. I've heard about them. Aren't they the things that help fuck the country up and put us into recession, Blower says. Oh, don't give me that one, Mark sighs. Give you what one, Cookie asks. What does he want, Hewitt says. He said he wanted something, Blowers adds. What did he say he wanted, Cookie says. Some cock, I think. I'm sure he asked for some cock, Hewitt says, deadpan. Ah, is it some cock you're wanting, is it, Blowers says. What? Mark looks to them. Don't be ashamed, mate. Cookie here likes cock too, Blowers says, indicating Cookie. Mark glances across at Cookie, but from his seated position he has to look up. What, you fucking pervert? Stop looking at my crotch. You ain't having my cock, mate. I'm not that kind of bloke, Cookie says in mock indignation. Well, you are really, Blowers says and winks to Cookie discreetly. Well, sometimes, I guess. And he is wearing a very smart suit. Cookie looks Mark up and down suggestively. What? Mark says. Nick, I think maybe we need to give Cookie and Mark some time alone, if you know what I mean. Blowers says across to Nick Hewitt. Oh, right, well, if you're sure, Cookie, Hewitt says seriously. Yes, mate, I'm very serious, but to be honest, lads, he looks like a regular to me. You might have to hold him down for me. Are you a regular, Mark? A what? Mark says in fear. A regular, mate. Will I have to get them to hold you down, or will you just bend over for me? Cookie says, fighting hard to keep his face straight. Mark looks from face to face, missing Cookie, trying not to laugh. Bend over then and drop them down, Blowers says. Fucking what? Mark says. He says what a lot, Nick says. He does, doesn't he? Don't keep saying what, Mark, Blowers says. What? Mark says. He did it again, Nick says. We don't have much time, Mark. Now be a good hedge fund banker and roll over and drop your pants and don't say what again or I might have to shoot you. Cookie says, lifting the end of his rifle up to wave it a few inches away from Mark's face. Mark freezes, and Cookie waves the rifle, indicating for Mark to move. Mark slowly rolls over and gets onto his hands and knees. Well done, mate. Now drop the pants, Blower says. Please, please don't do this, Mark begs. Now, now, shush, just drop your pants down, Nick says. Please, please don't, 
Please don't, Mark begs, as he starts scrabbling at his belt, tears streaming down his face. Bloody hell, he's a bit eager, isn't he? Blurs says in surprise. He is. He must love cock, Cookie joins in. Do you know, mate, I've never actually tried it, and they say don't knock it until you tried it, Blowers says, winking at Nick behind Mark's back. Actually, lads, I've always kind of fancied having a go myself. Would you mind if I jumped in too? Nick asks. No, mate, I'm sure Mark won't mind, will you, Mark? Cookie asks. Please, stop, please just don't do this, Mark cries, his voice cracking with fear. Come on, mate, get them trousers off, we haven't got all day, Blowers says, and Mark slowly pulls them off, one foot at a time, until he's bent over in his shirt, jacket, shoes and socks, with the little straps on his legs holding the socks up, begging and crying as he does so. Now, best close your eyes, mate, this might hurt a little, Cookie says as he unzips the front of his trousers slowly and loudly. Mark squeezes his eyes tightly closed. Nick... Cookie and Blowers slowly back away towards the ladder, Cookie taking Mark's trousers with him. They quietly climb down the ladder and run out of the front of the building, almost hysterical with laughter as they go. Chapter 42 This is for you, Howie says as he hands a pistol and ammunition to the old man. Thank you. Are you sure? the old man asks. Yes. You'll probably need it. There's plenty of people like Mark about, how he responds as the old man takes the gun. They both turn and watch as Nick, Cookie and Blowers run past them, laughing hard. What are you laughing at? How he calls out. Nothing, sir, Cookie says as he reaches the back of the Saxon and bends over, laughing hard next to Blowers and Nick. Right, we've got to be off. It was nice meeting you. Hopefully we'll see you at the forts, how he says as he shakes hands with the old man. Fuck me, look at that one. He's a bit late for the party, Darren Smith shouts. And they look over to see an undead slowly emerging from the access road into the car park, his slow and awkward shuffle bringing each step down heavily. I'll sort him out, Darren shouts and starts jogging towards him with his knife drawn. Jamie, see if you can drop him before Darren gets there. It'll wind him right up, McKinney urges as Jamie quickly pulls the sniper rifle out of the bag and raises it up to peer down the sights. Wait until he's just a few feet away. Make him run all the way there, Cookie says. Jamie lines up the sight and waits for Darren to get within a few feet, then squeezes the trigger just as Darren starts to lift his knife up. The zombie is blown backwards, away from Darren, who stops suddenly and turns back to the group, then sticks his middle finger up. The lads all cheer and start laughing as Darren starts walking back to them. Eventually, the people from Burger King are in the cars they arrived in, loaded up with supplies, sourced with help by Tucker, and they move out in a small convoy, leaving Howie, Dave and the recruits standing around the Saxon. So what was so funny when you came out? Howie asks again, then stares, puzzled, as all three of them double over again with fresh laughter. Howie looks to Dave, who is staring towards the entrance to the services. More of the recruits look over and burst out laughing. Howie turns to see Mark standing there, looking lost and dejected in the entrance, in his suit jacket, shirt and tie, socks and shoes. Where the bloody hell did his trousers go? Howie asks as he starts to smile at the ridiculous sight. Don't know, Nick gasps, gripping his sides, which ache from laughing. Right, well, let's get off before this gets any weirder. Howie chuckles as he climbs into the back of the Saxon and inches over into the front driver's seat. Bye, Mark, Cookie shouts in his best camp voice. Nick blows Mark a kiss, and they get into the Saxon and slam the doors closed to a fresh outburst of laughing. Mark stares at his trousers, trapped in the back of the door, and watches as the Saxon slowly pulls away. Chapter 43 As Darren jogged towards the zombie, the infection watched him coming. This undead is almost finished and has been going all night as the infection fights to keep the body working. One left in this area and it knows it doesn't stand a chance but sends it anyway. 
Darren nears the body and starts to lift the knife just as Jamie Reese squeezes the trigger of the sniper rifle and the bullet parts the air before it as it flies and strikes the zombie in the forehead. The zombie was just baring his teeth and a fresh surge of saliva was pumping into his mouth and spilling down his front. The bullet strikes and pulls the zombie clean off its feet as the head is thrown backwards. The saliva sprays out with the force of the movement and one tiny drop, invisible to the eye, sprays up high into the air and spins towards Darren, landing on his bottom lip. The drop is so tiny that Darren doesn't even feel it. Instead, he stops quickly, shocked at the sudden action of the zombie being thrown back. Darren turns and sticks his finger up at the laughing lads and starts walking back towards them. He can't help smiling as he walks and admits to himself that he would have done the same thing. One simple action seals his fate as he licks his dry lips and thinks of having a cool drink in the back of the Saxon. The infection is within that tiny drop of saliva. It is within every cell of every undead host it possesses. The infection feels the loss of the zombie as it is blown away, but it also feels the relief as the tiny drop rises high into the air and lands on the soft lips of Darren's mouth. Then the tongue comes out and draws the infection back into the mouth. The infection does what it was bred, designed and cultured to do. It multiplies by its own number again and again and forces those infected particles into the body. The saliva is drawn into the tongue, which absorbs down through the thick muscle and slowly pushes through into the blood vessels. Within minutes, the infection has passed into the bloodstream and is free. It is free to forge a path throughout this body and start to attack the systems, just as it has done with every host body so far. But then the infection stops before it starts to kill Darren, and it uses something the hosts use. Memories. The hosts can think back to something that happened before and use that information. The infection realises that this is one of the resistors. It recognises it now. It can attack this host and take it over within minutes. The infection can stop the heart and infect every cell within this host and make it turn. But the infection has evolved and learnt, and instead of purging this body to control it fully, it slows the rate of infection down and works slowly to infect it without killing it. The infection still pushes forward and slowly takes over the body, but it does so gently and reprograms its own very nature. The infection is on the inside of this group now and it can wait. It can be patient. The infection gains a hold within the brain and then uses the still living host body to watch through its eyes. It can see the resistors sitting to both sides and opposite. All of them are putting fluids into their mouths and making loud noises as they talk and smile. The infection can feel the vibration of the vehicle through the body of the host and can see through the eyes and hear through the ears and it works hard to understand what it is witnessing. The memories and images accessed from the billions of hosts it has already possessed make it easier to comprehend and the infection realises that it must stay hidden and be as covert as possible while slowly taking this body over. Darren leans forward to ease a sudden dull pain in his stomach and looks to the front of the vehicle to watch out of the windscreen. The infection observes the one they call Howie at the front of the vehicle, operating the controls. The smaller one that does so much killing is next to him. The infection sends no signals and makes no effort to control any part of this body. It silently slips into the cells and Darren shifts as dull pain hits at different parts of his body. You are right, mate? Tucker asks him, concerned at the look of discomfort on his face. Yeah, I'm all right, Darren replies as the pain eases off and he settles back to rest on the journey as the deadly infection quietly consumes his body from within. The Saxon armoured personnel carrier moves along the now empty motorway, passing fields of wheat and crops left unattended and wilting in the strong sun. The strong, bright rays bounce off the bare tarmac, keeping a permanent heat shimmer just ahead of the heavy vehicle, and Howie has to squint due to the bright glare bouncing back at him. Beads of sweat slowly slide down his face, and even Dave looks red in the face for once. On a normal day, it would take only a few hours to reach London, but, without traffic, hold-ups, accidents, or the normal day-to-day -day congestion, they move swiftly.
The rural fields slowly give way to the urban sprawl of Greater London. The houses by the side of the busy main roads are blackened from the constant daily smog of the exhaust fumes. The houses look run down and uninviting after the beauty of rural England. Their fronts made even worse as the signs of devastation slowly start to appear. At first, they see doors hanging off houses and windows smashed in. Some of the buildings are burnt out, and some still smoulder as the fire slowly eats away at them, threatening to flare up and reignite. As they pass further into the urban mess, they see burnt-out vehicles and signs of extreme civil disorder. Debris litters the roads and streets, and the front gardens of houses have their contents strewn about. Then the bodies start to appear. A few cadavers litter the roadside, but within a short distance they increase dramatically. Bodies torn apart from horrific injuries tell a tale of extreme violence. Bodies still clutching bats, knives and sticks lie still in pools of congealed blood. Swarms of flies buzz around them and spread disease from corpse to corpse. The rotting flesh is already falling apart, and the rate of decay increases as the high temperature slowly cooks the bodies and provides ideal breeding grounds for the writhing maggots eating them away. The rats would have slowly eaten everything in sight until just bones were left, but the rats were taken by the infection. The world's greatest scavengers have been used up, and now their bodies add to the decay. As the group venture deeper, the visible signs become worse. There are bodies everywhere, and nothing is left undamaged. The area looks like a war zone, with the road pitted and scarred from running pitch battles, bodies left where they fell. The Saxon follows a clear route through main roads, and the numbers of dead increase with every passing minute. The recruits all fall silent and lean forward to peer out of the windscreen at the horrifying scenes before them. Even Howie and Dave remain silent and watchful as they pass through. Movement! Cookie shouts from his position as lookout on the general purpose machine gun fixed to the top of the Saxon. Where? Howie shouts back, easing some of the speed from the vehicle. Off to the right! Someone saw us then legged it! Cookie shouts down. Okay, mate! Howie calls out. I suppose we're going to see more people here. I think I'd run away too if I saw us coming, Howie remarks to Dave, who nods back but remains silent as usual. The main road continues towards the city, traffic lights and pedestrian crossings now dull and lifeless. Houses give way to cheap shops that could not afford the higher rent and rates nearer the city. These too have been looted, trashed and burnt out and the contents thought useless by the looters has been cast aside on the pavement and road. Fuck me, it's hotter than hot, Howie says to Dave as he breathes in the heavy air. The heat is made to feel worse by the increasingly oppressive scenes in front and to the sides of them. Thick black smoke plumes into the air from a raging fire that is off to the left, but still they keep going forward further into the densely populated city. What the fuck is that? Cookie shouts down in alarm. Dave leans forward and stares at an object leaning against a lamppost further ahead down the road. Is that a body? Howie asks. Looks like one, Mr Howie, Dave answers. What the fuck? Howie questions as they draw nearer and get a clear view of an adult male hanging with a rope round his neck. The top of the rope is looped over the top of the streetlight curvature. Is that a zombie? Howie asks to no one in particular. There's another one. Dave points to a second body hanging in the same manner, but on the other side of the road. Who's done that? Howie mutters to himself. As the road sweeps around the next bend, there are bodies hanging from every lamppost. Twisted and gruesome. Some of them are clearly undead from the state of their injuries and the sickening pallor of their skin. Some are not so clear. As they drive on, Cookie looks to each body with morbid interest and can't help but take in the macabre scene unfolding in front of him. Fear creeps up his spine as he tightens his grip on the handles of the machine gun. This is interesting, Howie says to Dave. I bloody said it, didn't I? Every half an hour something happens. You did, Dave replies. Someone has been very busy here, Howie says. Some people. One person couldn't do this, Dave remarks as he looks to the bodies hanging high up the side of the lampposts. The road sweeps around the next bend, 
only for the scene to become more horrific. A large, stately building is on the left, with wrought iron gates and an iron fence running alongside the pavement. Each iron spike of the fence has a head impaled on it, each wearing a myriad of expressions. One of them is even smiling. Most have their eyes open, but not all of them have the red, bloodshot eyes of the zombies. This is fucking gruesome, Blowers says in the silence of the Saxon. Where's the bodies? Tucker asks as he takes in the impaled heads. The road signs are covered, Dave says to Howie. What? The road signs are covered or painted over. Look. Dave points to a large sign that once would have depicted the route ahead, but is now covered in a layer of black spray paint. Same over there, Mr. Howie. McKinney points to another sign off to the left. Are you following the road map, Dave? Howie asks, alarmed that they will become lost. I am, Blowers says. We just need to keep going straight on and follow the signs for the city. Well, that might be a bit difficult now, mate. Any other ideas? Howie says, more calmly. Just keep going straight. I think I know where we are on the map, and we just stick to the main road. I remember they put the letter C on the roads that led into the city, Blowers says. Well, what if they've covered them up too? Tucker asks, as the recruits in the back all stare at him. What? Tucker says, looking back at them. Then we just follow the covered up bits, Howie calls out. Oh, yeah, of course, Tucker says sheepishly. Why cover the road signs? Howie asks. To make people get lost, Tucker states. Ahead on the right, Cookie shouts, and they look ahead to see a junction on the right is blocked by several burnt-out cars pushed end to end. They pass slowly, expecting to see a barrier formed beyond it, just as Howie and Dave saw in Portsmouth, but the road is clear and empty behind the cars. Another junction on the left has the same thing, burnt-out cars stacked to block the entrance. The Saxon continues on the main road and soon comes to a large roundabout with three exits, one on the left, one ahead, and one on the right. The left and right are both blocked up with vehicles. The road is wide, and many vehicles have been pushed together to fully block the exits. Looks like they've been pushed there and then burnt out, Howie says as he looks to the vehicles all melted and fused together in one big clump. Same on both sides, McKinney states. Good job we need to keep ahead then, Howie jokes, but it falls flat in the tense environment. Do you think this is being done on purpose to keep us going ahead? Curtis Graves asks. They wouldn't know we were coming, Blowers replies. Whoever has done this couldn't know we were going to be coming along today, Howie says confidently. The Saxon keeps a steady pace, not too fast that Howie wouldn't have any reaction time, but not too slow to make them an easy target either. I haven't seen any zombies yet, Howie says, after another few tense moments of driving in silence. No, none, Dave replies flatly. This is getting creepy, Tucker says. Getting creepy? It's been fucking creepy for a long time, Blowers says. You're right, Smithy, Blowers adds, looking to Darren. Yeah, mate, why? Darren asks him. You look pale, mate, and you're very quiet. No, I'm all right, just tired, that's all. Darren says to him, as the recruits all look at him with concerned expressions. Honestly, I'm fine, just feeling tired, didn't get any sleep last night. Darren smiles. The lads all turn to face forward again and see more junctions blocked off with burnt and molten vehicles. Smoke ahead, Cookie bellows out, and within seconds, they see thick black smoke billowing up into the air further up the road. Make ready with your weapons, make sure you've got magazines in your pouches and your water bottles are full, Dave says to the recruits. Already done, Dave, Blowers says, and again makes the word Dave sound like the word Sarge. What is that? Howie asks, as they drive closer and closer to thick black smoke. A distinct smell hits them before they get close enough to see what is causing the fire, a smell of roasting, rotting meat. Oh, that's fucking gross, Cookie shouts. Tell him to come down and close the hatch, Howie calls out, and the message is passed to Cookie, who drops down and seals the hatch shut with a sigh of relief. That fucking stinks up there, Cookie moans, then takes a long drink of water. They reach the area of the smoke, 
and see a large public park on the right side of the road. Open gates lead into a big green area with football posts and a children's play area. A massive mound is burning in the middle of the green area. I guess that explains where all of the bodies went, Howie says as they slowly drive by. Dave rummages around the switches in the front and finally flicks one on. A whirring noise starts up and cool air is pushed out of the vents. Ah, oh, that's fucking better, Cookie remarks as he wipes sweat from his brow. Is that just to circulate the air in here? Howie asks Dave. Yes, Mr Howie. Not too long then, it'll burn more fuel, Howie says, to groans from the lads in the back. We don't want to have to blow up another fuel station, do we? Howie calls out. Would it be bad if I said yes? Nick jokes as the others snigger. You're all just delinquents, Howie replies as they keep going. The Saxon continues on the main road, which goes into a nicer area with big Victorian brick buildings on both sides. There are coffee shops and expensive boutiques on nearly every corner. Every one of them is looted and smashed in. The junctions are still boxed off, and soon they start to see vehicles positioned on both sides of the road, end to end. Large vehicles, vans and trucks are parked and blocking both sides. Just a wide single lane running down the middle of the road. The parked vehicles narrow the road and they see a large truck parked across the road ahead of them. The trucks on both sides now have cars stacked on top of them, forming high walls and a dead end ahead. Perfect ambush position, Dave says quietly. We're okay in here, aren't we? Howie asks him. For most things, yes. Small arms won't be a problem, Dave replies. What about the tyres? Howie asks. Run flat, Dave replies. OK, at least we can back away if we need to, Howie says, as he brings the Saxon to halt a few hundred metres back from the truck parked across the road. They sit in silence. The cool air blows into the interior and gives them a blessed few minutes of relief from the intense heat. Slowly, they see movement between the gaps on both sides. Shadowy figures move fast between the vehicles, then more movements up high as people on the other side climb up the vehicles. Within minutes, they see barrels poking out of the gaps and aiming directly towards them. The barrels waver for a few minutes as the people on the other sides position themselves, then all goes quiet. Has this thing got a public address system? Howie asks, and Dave starts rummaging around the front again, opening the small doors. He pulls out a truck-style microphone with a large button on the side. Howie takes the handset and stretches the cord over, presses the switch on the side and taps the front of the microphone. Nothing. There must be a switch somewhere, Howie says to Dave. That one there, Dave. Nick Hewitt leans forward and points to one of the switches. Dave presses it, and Howie again taps on the handset. A loud thumping noise sounds from the hidden speakers set around the vehicle. Here goes, Howie says quietly and presses the switch. Hello, anyone there? Howie's voice booms out into the quiet air. We are not looking for trouble, we just need to get through. Nothing happens, so Howie again presses the button. We just want to get through, we do not want any trouble. How many can you see, Dave? Howie asks quietly. At least twenty on both sides and more moving round behind them, Dave murmurs. Looks like we've got a reaction, Howie says, as a figure is seen crawling under the truck parked ahead of them. The person crawls out and slowly gets to his feet. There's more behind him, weapons trained on us, Dave murmurs again. Bloody hell, mate, you've got good eyes, Howie says, squinting into the gloom and just making out some movement under the truck. A very strange-looking man stands up and slowly starts walking towards them. He's tall and very thin with long, straggly blonde hair hanging limply down. Black sunglasses adorn his pale face and he's dressed all in black with just a flash of white socks as he bounces towards them. The man has a set of keys and other objects hanging from his belt. Looks like a fucking day-release patient, Cookie mutters behind them as the man slowly walks forward towards the Saxon. The man steps forward again and Howie waves him around to the driver's door, then cracks the window open a few inches. Hello, mate, Howie says through the window, trying to keep his voice friendly. Hello, the man says in a high-pitched voice and stands staring up at Howie. Um, 
Is everything okay? Howie asks, unsure of how to proceed. Yes, fine, thanks, the man says. So, is something wrong with the road? Howie asks, and the man shakes his head. Um, it's just that there's a big truck parked across it and we can't get through, Howie says. Big Chris put the truck there. I helped him, though, the man says to Howie. That's great. It's, uh, uh, a good truck. It's just blocking the road at the moment. The man nods back at Howie. Howie, in turn, looks over at Dave, who shrugs. He's a fucking nutter, Blowers says quietly. Howie turns back to the man. I'm Howie. It's nice to meet you. I'm Damien, the man says simply. Hi, Damien. I would get out to shake your hand, but I don't want to get shot by your friends. Howie smiles and nods up at the trucks parked to the sides. Oh, they won't shoot you, Damien laughs with glee and claps his hands. That's great. Did this big Chris send you out to speak to us? Howie asks. Yep, he said that I was the messenger. Damien nods seriously. Well, that's great, Damien. Did he give you a message then? Yep. And, uh, what is the message, mate? Oh yeah, ha, I forgot to tell you, didn't I? Damien slaps his own forehead and laughs again. A big Chris said to ask you what you want. Oh, can you tell him we just want to get through? Howie says. Okay. Damien stands still, smiling up at Howie, not moving. Uh, and also that we don't want any trouble, and it would be very nice of him to let us go through, Howie adds. Okay, Damien says and remains rooted to the spot. I was just thinking, Damien, that I forget messages too if I don't hurry and relay them. Maybe you should hurry so you don't forget, Howie says, kindly. Oh yeah, sorry. Damien turns and runs back to the truck, like a child with his arms up in the air. He gets to the truck, bends over dramatically and looks to be shouting through it. Jesus, he's a bit special, Cookie says. Relation of yours, is he? Blowers asks to a few sniggers. Fuck you, Cookie retorts. He's coming back, Cookie adds, as Damien runs back to them to stand by the side and stare up at Howie again. Hi, Damien, Howie says. Hi, Damien replies. Did you tell them our message? Yep. Okay, that's great. Thanks, mate. What did they say? Big Chris said to ask you where are you going? We're going into the city. Can you tell him that, mate? We just want to get through and be on our way. OK, Damien replies and again stands still. You'd best rush, mate, before we forget our messages, Howie prompts, and Damien runs off back to the truck. They watch him bending over and then start back towards them, before being called back and bending over again. Then finally he runs back to stand beside the driver's door. Hi, Damien waves up at Howie. Hi, Damien. What did he say? Howie asks. Big Chris said the city is gone, but I don't know where it's gone. He didn't say that, Damien says, looking confused. This is going to take all day, Howie says quietly to Dave. Maybe I'll just go and talk to them. I'll come too, Dave says. Not a question, but a statement. Dave, it might be best if you stay here and watch my back. Howie says, concerned that if they both get shot, it wouldn't leave anyone to get to Sarah, and would also leave the recruits on their own. OK, take blowers, Dave says. Blowers, you happy with that? Howie calls back. Yes, sir. Out the back or over the seat and out with you? Blowers asks. Hang on just a second, Howie says and turns back to Damien. Damien, can you tell Big Chris that we will come and speak with him? Make sure you tell him we are not armed. Can you do that? OK, Damien says excitedly and runs back towards the truck and bends over to shout the message through, pointing back at the Saxon. Howie presses the button on the handset microphone still in his hand and speaks into it. Two of us are coming out. We're not armed. Howie's voice booms in the enclosed area. I fucking hope he's not like that bloke in Portsmouth, Howie says to Dave. Me too. What bloke? Blowers asks as he puts his rifle down and prepares to climb over the driver's seat. 
Tell you later, mate. You ready? Howie asks. Yep. Howie slowly opens the door and climbs down to stand beside the Saxon, his hands clearly up. Blowers slowly climbs out and stands next to him. He sees Howie's arms up and raises his too. Nice and slow, mate, Howie whispers, and they walk towards the parked truck. They both hear as the driver's door of the Saxon is closed behind them. Howie looks up at the barrels moving along with them. They got a lot of guns, Howie says quietly to Blowers. Yeah, they bloody do, and they're all pointing at us, Blowers replies under his breath. They stop a few metres back from the truck and wait in silence. Then Damien stands back up and walks over to them. Big Chris said you can go through and talk to him. Thanks, mate. Do we go under that? Howie asks, pointing to the truck. Yep, follow me. Damien turns and walks to the truck and drops to all fours before crawling underneath it. Oh well, we're here now. Howie shrugs and starts after him. Blowers follows and they drop onto hands and knees to crawl under the vehicle. The smell of oil and rubber fills their noses as they proceed into the shade. They emerge into bright sunlight and look up to see many men staring down at them, all of them armed with various weapons, shotguns, handguns, rifles and even a few machine guns. One man stands in the centre. He's about average height but is very wide, with massively powerful shoulders and thick arms. Howie looks up at him and notices that he isn't pumped up like a bodybuilder, just a naturally big man who gives them an easy smile as they get to their feet. Just stand still for a moment, please. We need to be sure you're not armed, he says in a firm but polite voice. Two men move forward and pat Howie and Blowers down. They're thorough and take the time to check side pockets and waistbands. They move away and nod to the big man who takes a step. So, which one of you is the boss? He asks in the same polite tones. Blowers speaks first, indicating Howie. Mr Howie is. Nice to meet you, Mr Howie. I'm Chris. They shake hands and his giant mitt dwarfs Howie's hand, but his grip is surprisingly light. Hi, it's just Howie. Good to meet you. You must be Big Chris, Howie says, smiling and trying to avoid the name Mr Howie from catching on again. This is Blowers. Chris shakes hands with Blowers and turns straight back to Howie. So you must be the army then, Chris says politely. No, mate, we just kind of borrowed one of their vehicles. In army clothes? With this one calling you Mr Howie? Chris inquires with another rueful smile. Like I said, mate, it really is a long story. We're just trying to get through, but the truck is in the way. I tell you what, Mr Howie... It's a hot day and we're all melting out here. Step back in the shade with me and have a drink. Then you can tell me that long story. Chris turns and walks away from them, making it clear they're in his backyard now. Howie glances around to see the truck has enough room to roll forward, but not backwards, and the rows of vehicles are stacked up here too, forming another narrow roadway. They fall in step next to each other, and follow Chris further down the narrow lane. The armed men wait for them to go past, then fall in behind them, a few staying behind to mount the gateway. The narrow lane ends suddenly, and the wide road and pavement are ahead of them. Chris leads them to a London pub. Hanging baskets filled with flowers droop from iron railings. Wooden benches with sun parasols stretched taut over them offer a shady relief from the sun's strong rays. Howie and Blowers exchange a glance and then stare at the people already sitting at the benches and other seats nearby. There are families with children playing in the road and people walking about, some with purpose and others chatting amiably. The people stop and stare at the uniforms worn by Howie and Blowers. Although they are not in army greens, they both have tan-coloured combat trousers and black tops on, with utility belts hanging from their waists. Howie nods back and smiles at them as he passes. Blowers picks up on this, and soon he is offering nods and smiles to the people too. They seem comforted to see Big Chris with them, and within minutes they return to what they were doing, and the scene switches back to normal. Which is strange, as this road looks normal, with normal people dressed in normal clothes, and nobody walking around with horrific injuries. 
The people look clean and the road and pavements are free from litter. None of the buildings here have been looted and the windows are still intact. Armed men and women patrol through the crowds and Howie watches people stop and talk to them, chatting, normally. No signs of oppression or forced captivity, the street stretches away and they see more people walking about or sitting in the shade. This looks like a movie set, Howie whispers to blowers. Chris leads them to a wooden bench and nods at the people sat round nearby. They nod back, and when they see Chris take a seat and motion for Howie and Blowers to sit down, they start moving away. It's all right, you don't have to leave, Chris calls out, and Howie watches them closely for signs of forced behaviour. But they smile back naturally and politely make room. Sit down, lads, get out of that sun for a minute, Chris says, and they both sit down opposite him. An adult woman strolls out with three bottles of water and hands one to each of them, before smiling and stroking the back of Chris's neck. He smiles back sweetly and she strolls off back inside the pub. Chris takes a long drink and looks at Howie. So about this long story, he asks. Mate, I'm sorry, but this is staggering, Howie says, looking about. Not what I was expecting at all. What were you expecting? Chris says with a slight smile. I don't know, some kind of enforced camp or something, Howie says, still looking about at the idyllic scene. It looks nice, doesn't it? Took some doing there, I can tell you. But we've got more people arriving every day. And we try to squeeze them in, of course. We've got to be careful we don't get too big. But we can always expand out a little if we need to. It's amazing, Chris. How many people have you got here? Howie asks, genuinely impressed. Hmm... I think the last count yesterday was just over 2,000, Chris answers, as Howie's mouth drops. Bloody hell, 2,000, he exclaims. Well, that was yesterday, but more have arrived during the night and more today, so it has gone up a little, Chris explains. I don't know what to say. I went through Portsmouth and some bloke had formed a barricade, but he was keeping the people against their will and stockpiling all the supplies for himself and his mates. Right nasty bugger he was. How he says. Oh, don't get me wrong, lads. We have strict rules here. I won't pretend otherwise. But no one is held against their will. They can come and go as they please. People are going out all the time, going to their houses to get things they want or trying to find family and friends. We have a procedure, though, and no one gets back in without going through it. What procedure is that, if you don't mind me asking, mate? How he says, quickly adding the polite bit on the end in case he sounded too demanding. It sounds harsh, but we have sterile viewing areas where they have to strip off, but only so we can check them for bites and scratches, and we only use same-sex vetting, Chris says. We had to do a similar thing when we took refuge in a police station. It seemed horrible, but it makes sense. So let's talk about you for a minute, Chris says politely. You're saying you're not from the army. Howie explains how he and Dave started out, and how they met the recruits along the way. Chris listens patiently, asking pertinent questions at key points and going over certain bits again, until he's sure he understands it. So, we got this far, and then found your truck blocking the road, and if we can't get through, then I guess we'll have to go around. Chris leans back against a wall and finishes the bottle of water. I see. Well, it all seems to make sense. Of course, we have to be careful we don't let a load of armed soldiers in here without finding out who they are first, Chris says. Honestly, we are not soldiers, Howie protests. Lads, you're driving an army vehicle, carrying army guns, dressed like soldiers. He called you Mr. Howie, which shows me there is some element of control and discipline within your group. So, you are soldiers, Chris explains clearly. Yeah, I guess so, Howie agrees reluctantly. They sit in silence for a moment. What about you? How did this all come about? Howie asks, eager to find out. Chris leans forward to speak, but Howie interrupts him. Mate, I'm so sorry, but I just realised my lads are sat in the vehicle out there and it's sweltering. Can they come through? He asks quickly. Well, they can. But not with their weapons, Chris says, looking directly at Howie. I understand. 
What will happen to the weapons and vehicle if they leave it there? Howie asks. I can guarantee that it won't be touched. I can have one of my men drive it in, and you're welcome to have your men near it, but not in it. I will have my men nearby too, Chris says firmly. I understand, Chris, but we can't afford to lose that vehicle or weapons. It's the only chance we've got of getting through to the city, Howie counters. Sorry, Howie. Family is important, I understand that. But I've got over 2,000 people relying on me for safety and security, and I don't think they'll be impressed if I let a bunch of armed soldiers in here. They're just lads, Chris, only 18 years old, apart from Dave. Dave? Chris asks. You'll meet Dave. He's a... uh, different. An exceptional man, just a bit different, Howie says. And Chris leans back, staring at Howie as he thinks. Tell you what, let me and some of my men come out and check you all over first. The slightest whiff of bother, though, and, well, I think you know what will happen. Is that fair? Chris offers. Sounds more than fair to me, Howie says, looking at Blowers, who nods in agreement. A few minutes later, the truck is being pulled forward to save Big Chris having to crawl under it. Damien is still near the Saxon, staring at the windscreen from a few feet away. Who's he? Howie asks as they walk out to the Saxon. Damien, he's all right, can be a bit of a pest, but he's good at this sort of thing. He hasn't got a confrontational bone in his body, so he's ideal as a messenger for anyone that looks a bit naughty, Chris chuckles. A few armed men walk behind them, holding weapons ready, but aimed down to show they're not a threat. Yet. Howie is impressed by the control and discipline. Back at the Saxon, Howie walks with Chris and holds his hand up to Dave, motioning for him to come out. Dave opens the driver's door, and Howie calls for him to come out, unarmed. Dave pauses for a few seconds, then puts down his rifle and pistol. Chris? This is Dave. Dave, this is Big Chris. Howie introduces them and smiles as they shake hands, and Dave quickly wipes his hand down his trouser leg. Lads, come out the back but leave the weapons inside for a minute. Make sure none of you is armed, Howie calls out and hears shuffling noises as the lads move to the back of the Saxon and the rear doors open. They climb out stiffly, with red, sweating faces. That thing's an oven, Cookie moans as he steps down. I left the air on for you, Howie answers him. Dave switched it off, worried about the fuel, Cookie says, but is careful to show respect when mentioning Dave. The lads walk around to the side as Howie introduces them one by one. Chris takes the time to shake hands with them all, then excuses himself and walks around the back to look in the rear doors, coming back after a few minutes of close examination. Okay, Howie, you can come through, but it would make me feel a lot better if the weapons stayed in the vehicle, Chris says, finally. I'm not sure, mate. I. It all seems genuine, but like I said, we can't afford to lose them, Howie states. I understand. I guarantee they won't be touched by anyone inside. I'll have my men guard it, Chris offers. How about a few of yours and a couple of mine, Howie says, smiling at Chris. That way, we both feel better. Chris laughs with genuine amusement. If that makes you feel better, then okay, but I don't know what a couple of yours will do against the many we have in there, Chris laughs. Uh, It keeps the lads busy, if nothing else. Howie chuckles back to the groans from the recruits. Okay, come on through then. I'll get the truck pulled forward. Curtis, can you drive it through? Blowers and Cookie, you're first up on guard duty. Get your weapons now, but for fuck's sake, keep them lowered and fingers away from the triggers. Got it? They nod back as Curtis climbs back into the vehicle and through to the driver's seat. Blowers and Cookie both collect their weapons and hold them ready, but lowered as instructed. You happy with this, Dave? Howie asks as he falls into step with Dave. If you are, Mr. Howie, Dave replies. It looks really nice inside. Wait until you see it. They walk through the gap left by the truck and down the narrow lane. Dave and Howie follow Chris, flanked by some of the armed men. The Saxon is following slowly behind them, with blowers and cookie just in front of it. Howie glances back and catches them walking at a steady pace, looking about and smiling at the other armed guards. 
They do look like real soldiers, Howie thinks, and is glad he chose those two to take first guard. Their easy manner and banter will show them in a non-threatening manner. The lane ends and the lads all stare in amazement at the surreal scene in front of them. They follow Chris over to the wooden benches outside the pub and, within minutes, they're sitting down in the shade, drinking bottles of water. Thanks for that, Chris. They won't be any bother to you, I promise, Howie says in earnest. They seem good lads. Young, though. Chris rubs his chin as he stares at the recruits. So you were saying how all this came about, Howie reminds him. I was. Well, I was born and raised here. I know pretty much everyone, and they know me. I was in this boozer when it started. We got some rough lads that drink in here, lads that can handle themselves, if you know what I mean. So we were able to keep them away. More people joined us in the pub, and we fought out and cleared this street here first. Then, as more people arrived, we pushed out and kept gaining ground. We didn't attack them as much as remove them. I worked on the principle of securing ground and preventing them getting back in. We used local resources to form barriers and barricades, and over the next few days, we found ways of getting our people in and out safely. Then a couple came back bitten and risked everyone else, so we put the vetting procedures in place. We were lucky, as we've got a few doctors and nurses and ex-army medics with us. They're setting up a little hospital... We send foraging parties out during the day with strict instructions not to engage unless absolutely necessary. Their primary function is to gather supplies, medicines, equipment, fuel, food, all the things we need to survive. Even the doctors have no idea how long this will last, so the plan is to keep secure and try and wait it out, Chris finishes. And you're in charge of all this, Howie asks, and Chris ponders the question. Yes, I am. But only in the sense of putting the right people in the right places and making sure the area is secure. Lads, I come from a hard background. I served in the forces and then fell into some not very nice things. I've had all sorts of jobs, and I guess I was just in the right place at the right time when this happened. What were you in? Dave asks, the first time he's spoken since they sat down. I was in the parachute regiment, but that was years ago. I did some other stuff with other departments and worked overseas for a while, helping teach guerrilla tactics. Like I said, I came out and did some naughty things and served a bit of time. What were you in? Chris returns the question to Dave. I was special forces, Dave answers, and how he almost spits his drink out in surprise. Dave has always answered, I can't say, when anyone has asked him that. I thought you were, Chris says. I met a few of them. Worked with a few too. Mind you, most special forces never say they were special forces, he says, staring intently at Dave. I don't normally, but I can see the regimental tattoo on your arm, and you wouldn't get that without actually serving. The regiment lads would never let that happen. I've met your lads before, and they all have that same look about them too, Dave responds, holding direct eye contact with Chris. How many exits have you noted? Chris asks, without looking away. There are four immediately obvious. One, the way we came in, but your people are still on those high sides, providing a perfect ambush site, so that exit is negated. My assumption from the way these people were walking about is that the exit points are secure with armed men. Two, these buildings are deep and would lead out into the area that you have not secured, and you'd be using the natural building line as a barrier. Those windows and doors would lead out. Three, these buildings have connecting roofs, which could be used to move from one to the other to a non-secure area, Dave finishes, still staring back. What's for? Howie asks. They both remain silent for a few seconds before Chris replies, I'm for. You take me and you could walk out untouched, he slowly smiles. You have a mixture of weapons and have used the rifles as sniper points, keeping the shotguns further back to make use of the power and keep a clear firing line. The armed people patrolling this area are made up of services and police. The services people hold their weapons in a permanent state of readiness, with the fingers stretched over the trigger guard. The police walk differently, with a steady tread, due to the fact they spend long periods on patrol. You covered the road signs to keep people, or those things, confused as to where they were going. You strung the already dead bodies up and the heads on spikes to show any possible other survivors that you were not to be messed with and to send a clear signal to any potential invaders. 
Dave says, flatly, to an enormous grin spreading across Chris's face. Okay, okay, well done, you've convinced me, Chris laughs, and finally breaks away from Dave's intense stare. I see what you mean, Chris says to Howie, nodding towards Dave. The heads and hanged bodies send a strong signal, but most of them were dead already. Like I said, I don't go actively looking for them. Are they stacked up at the exits, Howie asks. Some of them are, massive crowds of them. A few of our exits have been kept quiet, though, and we use our people to lure them away when they get too many. So what have you heard about the city? Howie asks. It's a few miles from here and completely overrun. Where's your sister? Canary Wharf, Howie replies. That's going to be hard, very hard. None of us have ventured that deep. I know most of the roads that way are infested. Well, we have the Saxon and plenty of ammunition, so we should get through, Howie says, watching Chris, who seems deep in thought. Have you thought about your route in? He asks eventually. We have a road atlas. We'll work from that, Howie replies. Right, I'm thinking of something here. We might be able to help each other out, Chris says slowly. Come with me. I want you to meet someone. He gets up and starts walking away from the bench. Howie and Dave shrug at each other and follow him out from under the shade of the parasol and into the hot sun again. Stay here, lads. We'll be back soon, Howie says, as the recruits all start getting to their feet. You all right, Darren? You don't look well, mate. Howie stops in front of him, looking with concern at the pale and sweating face of Darren Smith. I'm fine, Mr. Howie. Just this heat, I think, Darren replies, wiping at his forehead. Get plenty of fluids, mate. You might be dehydrated. Stay in the shade, too. Howie walks off with Dave, following Chris down the street, past the big Victorian buildings and the groups of people walking through the area. They reach a side street and see the end is fully blocked off with stacked vehicles and other items forming a high and substantial barricade. Armed guards watch from over the barricade, out of open windows on the adjacent buildings. If we don't make the forts, this wouldn't be a bad second choice, Howie says to Dave as they follow Chris further up the street. Seems nice, Mr Howie, Dave agrees. Chris stops at the doorway to a large building and pushes the door open. Two armed guards are outside, leaning against the wall, smoking cigarettes. Come in here, lads. Chris walks into the gloom of the building, followed by Howie, then Dave. They enter a reception area, with wooden flooring and doors leading off to both sides. A woman appears, wearing a white lab coat with a stethoscope hanging from her neck. Hi, Chris. Everything okay? She asks, with a genuine smile to the big man. Hi, Doc. Yeah, everything is fine. Just showing these lads about. Is Doc Roberts about? Chris replies, smiling at the pretty doctor. He's around here somewhere. Make sure you clean your hands if you go in. She disappears through another door. This is the hospital we set up. We've got operating rooms and triage points through those doors. It's very basic, but okay for now. Come with me. Chris opens a door to the right and walks through. Howie and Dave enter a wooden panelled room with rows of beds on both sides. The beds are occupied by sleeping figures swathed in bandages and dressings. The beds are valuable, and only the most seriously injured use them, Chris explains quietly as they walk down. Stop right there, please. An older man, wearing a white lab coat, calls over in a firm voice. Clean your hands, the man gestures for them to go back, waving his arm. Sorry, Doc, Chris calls out, and takes them back to a desk next to the door they came through, picking up a large bottle of antibacterial hand wash and applying it liberally on his hands before offering the bottle to Howie. That's Doc Roberts, Chris says. He's in charge of the hospital. He smiles as the older doctor approaches them. Good to see you, Chris. Everything all right out there? Dr. Roberts asks, raising thick grey eyebrows over bright, intelligent eyes. Yes, Doc, this is Howie and Dave. They arrived a short time ago from the south. It's as bad down there as we thought. Hmm, I thought it would be. Good to meet you, the doctor nods at them. You too, Doctor. Have you any idea what's causing this? Howie asks. Not a clue, the doctor says. 
The infection can enter from saliva or blood, and once it's in the body, it takes everything over. None of us have ever seen anything like it before, but we don't have the equipment or the means to start examining it properly. Which is why we've come to see you, Doc, Chris says. These lads are going to Canary Wharf. There's a few of them, and armed to the teeth, too. Might be a good chance to try for that hospital you mentioned. Excellent. I will prepare a list immediately. Ideally, I want to send someone with you, but I cannot afford to risk losing any trained people, the doctor replies instantly. We need equipment, surgical implements, and as many medicines as you can find. I'll get on it now. My list will be ready in ten minutes. The doctor turns and walks back down the room and through another door. Well, that's that then. Chris shakes his head as he leads them out of the hospital and back into the street. Chris, we don't have time to do a hospital raid for you, Howie says politely. If we can get Sarah and bring her here, maybe we can go back. But I have to get her first. And no, that's not what I'm thinking. I think we could join forces and go with you. That armoured personnel carrier will be an ideal support vehicle, and if we combine our forces, we should get through a lot easier. So how would it work? Howie asks as they walk back down the street towards the pub. The hospital is on the way. Well, just a very minor deviation. But if you help us get to the hospital, we'll go with you for your sister. We combine the strength of our forces and work together, Chris explains. Why that hospital? London is huge and there must be other ones closer. Dr. Roberts helped design it and he was in charge of it. It's brand new and he knows every piece of equipment in there and the exact layout too. Plus, it received a huge funding allowance for infectious disease research so he wants some of the equipment from that area in particular. It does make sense, I guess. How long will it take before you're ready to go? Chris stops to consider the question nodding his head from side to side. An hour or so? They agree to meet near the Saxon, and Howie returns to the pub and calls Blowers and Cookie over. We've got a plan, Howie says once they're all grouped round. We're heading into the city, to the Canary Wharf area, where my sister lives. Chris said the area will be overrun, but we have the Saxon and weapons with plenty of ammunition. They nod back at him. Chris wants to do a raid on a special hospital on the way. There's a doctor here who got some funding for an infectious disease research lab. He wants to join forces, and we'll help him with the hospital, and he helps us get to Sarah. I've said yes, but I'm open to any questions or concerns from you guys, Howie finishes and looks to each of them. I'm happy, Cookie offers first. With men's arses, Blowers mutters to a few chuckles. I'm in too. Me too, Hewitt says. We're coming back through here on the way back, though. That's the plan, Nick. It looks nice here, doesn't it? I was thinking this would be my second choice if the forts don't work out. The recruits nod. The extreme contrast from the incredibly degraded urban area, the battles, the violence and extreme upset they have already faced, is stark against this calm area, full of normal-looking people going about normal lives and it reminds each of them of what they've lost. Lads, this is a personal mission for me, to save my sister, and I've said from the beginning you don't have to do this. Any of you can stand down and stay here, or choose to do what you wish, with no comeback from me. You're all young, and your lives have already been devastated enough. You don't have to keep going with this, Howie says, in earnest. No, I'm still in. we come this far. Be a shame to stop now, and besides, there's still a shitload of them fucking zombies to kill. Hewitt is the first to speak his mind. I'm with Hewitt, Cookie adds. In more ways than one, Blurs says quickly. Stop with the fucking gay jokes, you dick, Cookie says, exasperated. You want dick? Blurs retorts with a smile. Before them two get going again, I want to say I'm in too. Tucker holds his hand up. And me, McKinney adds. The rest add their affirmation with nods and grins. You lot must be fucking mad, Howie says, grinning back at them. But I am glad you're on my side, though. I wouldn't want to face you lot in a fight. Fucking right, Cookie says with firm conviction. Chapter 44 
Darren Smith works alongside the recruits, unloading the weapons from the Saxon and stripping them down for cleaning under the watchful eye of Dave. He sweats heavily, but then the weather is scorching and everyone else sweats too. His skin flushes red, and at times he feels dizzy, but then the others also look flushed, and after everything they've been through, Darren puts it down to stress, heat, and the constant action. The infection works slower than it ever has done. Each host it has taken so far has been consumed totally, within minutes. Each cell infected and brought to destruction, so the infection can restart the body, fully in control. But this time is different. It's Darren's heart that beats and pumps the blood. It's Darren's brain that sends the electrical impulses that drive the body forward and Darren's mind which processes the thousands of images the eyes take in, and this brain that matches those eyes to the sounds recorded by the ears. The infection learns how a host controls this body with ease. The infection resists the urge to take control and instead allows Darren to look where he wants, and the infection observes the thousands of uninfected humans just waiting to be taken. The infection looks to the way they move and walk about freely and then uses the eyes of the surrounding host bodies to try and work out their position. But the humans here have been smart and not attacked the hosts in great numbers. So the infection has allowed the host bodies to drive themselves and gather at the points they last saw the uninfected. But now it realises there must be pockets like this all over the world. It's only a matter of time before the infection can pick them off, one by one. The infection feels the reaction with Darren when the one they call Howie speaks. It observes the chemical reaction that invokes a change and it recognises the thought processes that fly through the mind as Darren listens intently. Darren deeply admires and respects Howie, and also the small one that is always next to him. Darren feels a great sense of loyalty to this man and the infection picks up on this and knows it can work to learn how to use these chemicals and feelings to control more of the host bodies. Howie is their leader, but as much as the infection controls the host bodies, they are not led. They are forced to do as the infection wills, but maybe they could use a leader and the infection could make them feel loyalty towards that leader. It hears the one they call Howie talk about Sarah and a place called Canary Wharf and the city. And the infection scours through billions of memories and thought processes to work this out. It slowly begins to understand the area they are going to, and, using the memories of infected taxi drivers, bus drivers, policemen and postal workers, it develops an understanding of the route they will take, of the path that lies before them and the end destination. Within Canary Wharf and the surrounding streets and neighbourhoods, all of the undead stop and turn to face the route Howie and the resistors will take. Those on the outskirts are sent shuffling in that direction, and other survivors are amazed and greatly relieved to see hordes of zombies moving in one mass, filing towards another area. The infection has already once made the mistake of making them move too fast too soon, and weakened the feeble bodies but now it will keep them slow, repairing until the time is right. The infection has learned to plan ahead, and it will do it right this time. Chapter 45 Sarah wakes up late on Wednesday morning, her head aching as she lifts it from the pillows. Her hair is splayed out and messy and her throat feels dry. She slowly rolls to the edge of the bed and pushes her legs over the side, her feet knocking into the empty wine bottles left by the side of the bed. With a groan, she looks at the several bottles lying throughout the room and slowly remembers the righteous decision she made to get smashed. Not a heavy drinker anyway, the alcohol had a rapid effect on her due to her empty stomach, which now heaves in complaint at the harsh chemicals forced into it the night before. She runs to the toilet and just manages to lift the lid as she vomits into the bowl, retching and dry heaving until nothing but bile comes up. She sinks down and rests her pounding head on the cool tiles of the floor, regretting every single gulp of wine she took. She started off listening to thumping rock tracks on her iPod, but as the alcohol took effect, 
She selected the slower songs until she was wallowing in self-pity, listening to power ballads over and over. She doesn't even recall getting into bed, but gets flashbacks of dancing naked in the tiny apartment after stripping off her clothes in the sultry heat of the evening. Sarah lies on the floor, with sweat pouring off her body and the rancid taste of bile in her mouth. She slowly gets up and crawls to the corner shower cubicle, closing the door behind her. She reaches up and twists the water flow on, giving a scream as the freezing jets of water soak into her before sliding down to lie on her side and let the water cleanse her. Chapter 46 Howie drives the Saxons slowly down the main road, nodding and smiling at people as they step out of the way. Armed guards walk in front and to the sides of the vehicle, reassuring the residents of the commune that all is okay with their presence. I like that crisp bloke, Howie says to Dave. He seems okay, Dave replies. Nice place, this. Yes, Mr Howie. So how come you decided to be open about your military background, Howie asks. It served a purpose. We needed him on our side, and the parachute regiment always worked well with our lot. So it was a tactic? Yes, Mr Howie. Smart move, mate. That stuff about the exits was clever too, and the way he realised he was the fourth. That was impressive. Thanks, Mr Howie. No, mate, I mean it. This heat is getting worse. There must be a storm coming. Maybe. I've never known it so hot. Even the road surface is melting. I can see. Have you known it hotter than this? A few times, Dave replies. Where? The jungle is hot and humid. It just saps the blocks and drains them. The desert is different. Dry heat with no escape. What do you prefer, heat or cold? Howie asks. I don't mind. I did service in cold places and hot places. It doesn't bother me too much. You must have a preference. Not really, Mr Howie. How about you? I thought I loved the heat, but I'm having doubts now. Sitting on a beach in Spain with a cold beer is slightly different than running around the country killing zombies. I guess so. Never been to Spain. Well, I went to Gibraltar once. Does that count? Gibraltar? Well, that's a British place, but it's in Spain, so yeah, I guess it does. Where did you go on holiday? I didn't. What about downtime or when you had time off? I stayed at the base or went back to get ready for the next mission. Bloody hell, mate, never had a holiday. No, Mr Howie. Well, maybe after this ends you should take one. This won't end, Dave says, flatly. It has to end sometime, one way or the other, Howie says, quietly staring dead ahead. The end of the road sees a repeat of the entrance area. Vehicles piled high on both sides to form solid walls, and another big truck parked across the gap. The road they travelled down to get here was surprisingly long, and how he realises how much effort and work Chris and his group have put into securing space and then keeping it secure. This is just the main road, though, and the safe area extends out to both sides, taking in side streets and more buildings to house the increasing number of people living here. How he realises this cannot be sustained after the devastation they've witnessed. This place looks ideal, but with increasing numbers of displaced refugees, there will be increasing numbers of problems. The food they can source from raiding parties will last for a while. The city housed millions, so finding food for a few thousand will be easy enough for a while, but after that, they will need renewable supplies. The water supply is another thing, maintained by experts who clean and sanitise it with chemicals and keep the flow going. Who will do that now? Who will secure a constant supply of fresh water, not just for drinking, but for bathing and cleaning too? Children will need milk and fresh food and education, and as nice as this environment seems now, unless they start long-term planning, they will soon perish. These people will settle into their new lives and the pain and loss they have suffered will fade. After that, they will become like any other society, greedy, selfish, wanting more and questioning those in charge. Chris rules the roost now, but it won't be long before someone else emerges and challenges him. At the moment, they look to him for safety and security and are thankful for the efforts he's taken and the control measures he's put into place. 
Will he be able to maintain that calm exterior when he's challenged? Or will power corrupt and turn him into a despotic tyrant, enforcing his rule with an iron will? The truck is already pulled back to reveal the stretch of road on the other side. Chris is positioned next to another large truck, looking up and speaking to someone in the cabin. There are a few four-wheel drive vehicles waiting on the road, and more vehicles parked up, vans, sports cars and motorbikes. There are more vehicles piled high on the sides here too, but the road is wider, and Howie realises this is still a sterile area, but used now as a car park for the commune's small fleet of various vehicles. There is another large truck parked further down the road, forming the end of the barricade. The other side must be the unsecure area. The Saxon rolls up behind a four-wheel drive vehicle which is immediately behind the truck. There are plenty of men here with automatic weapons, some dressed in part police clothing and some in a mishmash of army and civilian clothing. They've kept the best weapons for this lot, Dave remarks, looking around at the armed groups. Where did they all come from? Howie asks. Most of them look like police issue, although there are some military weapons in there too. Chris walks over to them, and Howie jumps down to meet him at the front of the Saxon. You all ready? Chris asks. Yep. What's the plan? Howie asks, as another man carrying a black machine gun walks up to join their group. Dave slides out of the Saxon and comes round to join them too. Howie, this is Malcolm. He was in the regiment with me. Chris introduces them as they shake hands. I was thinking, Chris, we either need the weight of the truck at the front to plough through them, or the main fighting vehicle, which would be the Saxon here, Malcolm says. If the truck is the main vehicle to bring supplies back, then it should be kept safe and protected in the middle, Dave says in a firm voice. Is this the special forces guy? Malcolm asks Chris. Can't you tell? You're getting old and rusty, mate, Chris jokes. Piss off, you fat bastard, Malcolm fires back as Chris laughs. Howie watches the exchange and can't help but be reminded of Blowers and Cookie. He's right, though, Chris says. We need the hospital supplies and the truck is the only vehicle they will all fit in. I think we'll keep it in the middle and use the Saxon as the point vehicle. How much ammunition do you have for the GPMG? Chris asks Dave. Plenty. I took all of it from Salisbury, Dave answers, as both Chris and Malcolm raise their eyebrows. All of it? Fucking hell, mate, you going to war? Malcolm asks. Yes, Dave answers, to an uncomfortable silence, broken by Chris coughing politely. <clears throat> so that settles it then. The Saxon in the lead with the truck behind, and then the four-wheel drives behind them as support vehicles. How many people do we have? Dave asks. You have your lot in the Saxon, that's ten, isn't it? Chris asks. Yeah, eight recruits, Dave and I. We've got two in the truck cabin, one is the driver, but he's got no experience of weapons, so we've put a bloke in there with him. Then four in each of the four-wheel drive vehicles behind the truck. I'll be in the first one with three lads, and Malcolm in the second with another three. All of them are hand-picked and have served in the military or the armed police, Chris explains. Signals and communications, Dave says. We've got some shortwave radios we've got from some bouncers. They will work for a few hundred metres, but that's it. The Saxon is Alpha, the truck is Bravo. I will be Charlie, and Malcolm will be Delta. Keep it simple. You happy? Chris asks the small group. Yep, Malcolm answers, and both Howie and Dave nod in agreement. A very large-built, muscular man with a bald head and a tight black T-shirt approaches them, carrying small black radios. He hands them out to each of them. They got fresh batteries. Use channel one, the man says in a very deep voice. How long will they last? Howie asks. They lasted all night on the doors, and that's with constant use, so they'll be good for the day, the man answers, before walking off. As he turns, Howie sees a small machine gun hanging from a strap across his back, previously hidden by his immense girth. Did he serve with you too? Howie asks as the man walks away. Yeah, good bloke. Looks like an animal, but he's as calm as they come, Malcolm answers. Uh, what about the route? None of us know London very well, Howie suddenly asks. You got that road atlas handy, Chris asks, and Dave runs back to pull it out from the front of the Saxon. Chris takes a red pen from his pocket 
and marks along the roads. It's pretty much a straight run up to Tower Bridge. I suggest we plan an RV just before the bridge and go from there, Chris says, handing the atlas back to Dave. Howie looks at the marked route, which does look like an easy run. Right, we'll go round the front. Shout when you're ready to move off, Howie says. One more thing. Our ammunition is good, but it won't last forever. So we'll be relying on your lads and the GPMG to do most of the shooting, Chris says, before walking off with Malcolm. You happy with the plan, Dave? Howie asks, relying on his military skill and tactical sense. Yes, Mr Howie. Do you want me to be comms up? Uh, if I knew what that was, I would answer you. Communication operative. Oh, you want the radio? Howie asks as he hands the small device with the stubby aerial to Dave. Dave accepts it without a word. Howie drives the Saxon round to the front and pulls in ahead of the truck, while explaining the plan to the lads in the back. So, we're going right into the city then? McKinney asks. Yes, mate. At least we get to see some sights. Tower Bridge, maybe Big Ben, spot a lunch in Covent Garden, taking a show in the West End, then into Soho for some fun. The lads cheer at the idea and start talking about how many beers they would drink and how many women they would pull. This is Charlie, radio check. Radio check, Delta, are you reading me? The radio crackles to life in Dave's hand. Delta receiving loud and clear, Charlie. Charlie to Bravo, radio check. Bravo receiving loud and clear, Charlie. Charlie to Alpha, radio check. Dave answers in a crisp, clear voice. Alpha receiving loud and clear. Roger that, Alpha. All units loud and clear. Radio check complete. Alpha will maintain point. Bravo to keep a close distance, but be ready to hold back in case of contacts. Ready when you are, Alpha. Chris's voice booms through the radio. Alpha to Charlie. Do you want notice if we establish contact? Dave asks into the radio. Charlie to Alpha. Yes, if you have time. But all units be aware in case Alpha opens up without notice. Do not run into the arc of fire. Roger that, Charlie. Moving out now. Dave answers and looks to Howie, who slowly drives forward. The truck blocking the road starts up and gently pulls forward to reveal the clear road beyond. The Saxon pulls out and proceeds down the road at a slow speed until the follow vehicles are clear of the barricade and then gently increases the speed. Who's up top? Howie asks Dave. Hewitt. Blowers, make sure that Hewitt shouts down before he opens up on anything. We just want to get there and back quickly. The signs soon start appearing. First some debris on the road, then bodies lying festering in the high heat. Corpses of rats and people lie where they dropped. Windows of houses are smashed in. Vehicles are burning, and there's blood everywhere. The already hardened people within the vehicles look out to the extreme scenes, and despite being in countless war zones... Each of them feels a sense of loss and pain at the things they see. Hewitt half pokes out of the hole in the roof of the Saxon, holding onto the handles of the GPMG tightly, partly for balance, but also for comfort. After all, he's an 18-year-old man in charge of a heavy-caliber machine gun, while riding his point vehicle for an armed convoy, undertaking a daring raid and rescue mission. The Saxon reaches a junction and Dave indicates to take a right turn, Within minutes, they start to see undead zombies all shuffling in the same direction that they are going. Ahead, sir! Hewitt shouts down. The priority is to get there, but fucking look at this lot! Why are they going in the same direction as us? Howie calls out. I don't know. They're not even turning to look at us, Dave answers. Dave, let them know we're opening up and someone tell Hewitt he can crack on and slaughter as many as he can. How he calls out. Alpha to all units, large groups ahead and to the sides. We will fire on them. Over. Hewitt, Mr. Howie says to crack on and get as many as you can, Blowers shouts up. Thank fuck for that, Hewitt mutters and racks the bolt back to engage the chain. A grim smile forms across his face as he squeezes the trigger slowly. He feels the pressure as the trigger depresses under his finger and the machine gun comes to life spewing hot lead into the backs of the zombies as they shuffle in front of the Saxon. The massive bullets rip into them, shredding their bodies and ripping them apart as the general-purpose machine gun roars with vengeance. Sir, can we open the back doors and shoot them down? 
Cookie shouts out. Fucking do it! Kill them! Kill them all! Howie bellows. The rear doors burst open and recruits lean out to fire left and right at the slow, shuffling undead zombies, ripping them apart and wreaking revenge. What the fuck are they doing? Chris shouts from his position as passenger of the four-wheel drive vehicle. Having fun by the looks of it, Chris, one of the men in the rear says. Chris spins around to see them both grinning and he shakes his head as a slow smile spreads across his face. Fuck it, why not, he says, as he winds the window down and points the end of his assault rifle out. The Saxon leads with the recruits taking it in turns to man the GPMG and slaughter the undead from the top position. The rest take turns to shoot from the rear doors, yelling and cheering as they take them down. The ones closest to the back doors are gripped from behind by the recruits further in to save them falling out. The passenger of the truck is leaning out of the window, firing down into the hordes as they pass. Both of the four-wheel drive vehicles have barrels pointing out of the windows, firing into the dense hordes. There are thousands and thousands of zombies slowly staggering into London, strung out in long, shuffling queues. My fucking turn! Brace yourselves! Howie bellows. Braced! Blowers shouts back as the recruits all grab a handhold and the ones closest to the doors step back inside. Howie gently veers to the side and inches closer and closer to the zombies that are strung out ahead of them. The solid, plated, heavy Saxon clips the first one, who gets spun off, taking out more undead next to him. The Saxon holds a steady course as Howie slams its front right wing into the backs of the horde, pulverising them and sending them splattering off. The vehicle takes the punishment without hesitation and they leave a broken and bloody trail of mashed up zombies behind them. Howie pulls off to the left, creating a bloody slick behind the Saxon. He keeps going for several minutes as the GPMG starts up again, and through the view of the windscreen, he sees bodies burst apart, blood spraying high and slamming into the thick glass screen. The recruits resume their killing from the rear doors as they slaughter every one of the zombies that they can hit. Many escape the deadly firing, but many more are cut down and left to rot on the road. Ahead! McKinney shouts from his position up top. Howie and Dave both lean forward and peer down the road to another junction, completely blocked by a massive horde. They're trying to walk into a smaller side street, but the immense size has clogged them at the junction, and more join the back of the crowd pushing forward. It feels like they know where we're going, Howie says to Dave. I agree, Dave answers. We're definitely being targeted. Looks like it, Mr Howie. Howie brings the Saxon to a slow crawl, just back from the massed horde, all facing the other way at the junction. Alpha to units, road is blocked ahead, Dave transmits over the radio. We'll have to take them out, Howie says, staring at them, and his left hand drops down to touch the top of the axe handle sticking up. Dave catches the movement and looks at Howie. Alpha to all units, we're going to take these out, Dave says, still staring at Howie. Charlie to Alpha, are you using the GPMG? We can't hear it. Is there a problem? Chris asks. Dave pauses to look at Howie, at the darkness starting to seep in across his face. Dave notices Howie's breathing has become slightly faster as he stares intently at the horde facing them. Alpha to Charlie, negative. We are doing this the old-fashioned way. Stand by. Chapter 47 Dave drops the handset next to me, but all I can see are the hundreds of zombies stacked up in front of us. They're targeting us, going to our location, somehow knowing where we are heading and trying to get there ahead of us. They have taken my mother and father, and now they threaten to destroy the rescue attempt of my sister. No, this isn't a rescue attempt. This is a rescue. I will get to her, and I will find her. These things will clearly do everything they can to stop me, but I will prevail. My breathing increases, and I feel him inside me. He went away after the last battle, but now he's back and he wants another payment. Anger is knocking at the door again, and he's brought his associates' fury and rage with him. They want payment too, and they won't stop until they get it. I pause at the door, my hand resting on the handle. I know what will happen if I open the door. 
I can see what will happen. I want that to happen. I want it more than anything. My hand grips the axe handle and I look across to Dave, who is staring at me intently. There is a look in his eyes that I haven't seen before. The anger is within him too. I can hear it knocking at his door and demanding payment. I twist slowly in my seat and look into the rear of the Saxon. Eight young faces stare at me with grim expectation. Eight faces watch me, and I see those eight faces struggling to contain the violence that is threatening to burst out. Eight young faces that have seen more violence and destruction than most see in a lifetime. Blowers, McKinney, Cookie, Smith, Tucker, Hewitt, Reese, and Graves all stare back at me. No one speaks, for we can all hear the anger and the rage and the fury knocking at the door. Our hands rest, waiting for the second when we can open the door and unleash hell. I look back to Dave slowly and stare into the killer's eyes. I nod to him once and watch as he slowly draws breath in. Fix bayonets! Dave roars at the top of his voice, a drill sergeant voice, a parade square voice that booms round the buildings and the horde starts shuffling around to face us. Ready, Dave? Yes, Mr. Howie. Ready, lads? Yes, Mr. Howie, they roar, and I'm out, flying through the air with my glorious axe in hand. Dave has done the same, both of us leaving our assault rifles in the vehicle as I swing my axe in preparation and Dave turns his knives back against his wrists so that the blades rest up against his forearms. We pause as the recruits pile out of the back and stand behind us, a thin line with me and Dave out front. The horde turns and starts their shuffle towards us. We wait. They shuffle and groan, and we wait. I hear clicks as bayonets are fitted. I turn to look and see a few of them have left their rifles in the vehicle and are just holding their long, deadly bayonet knives down at their sides. Jamie Reese has one in each hand, like his idol, Dave. They shuffle, and we wait. Chris bursts out of the four-wheel vehicle and starts walking forward past the truck. His men join him, just as Malcolm and his group run to catch up. What are they doing? Malcolm asks. They said the road was blocked, Chris replied. Why aren't they using the GPMG then? I don't know. Fuck me. They all stop to stare at Howie and Dave standing in front of the recruits. Howie holds a long-handled axe down at his side. Dave has a long-bladed knife in each hand. The lads stood behind them with a collection of knives and rifles fitted with bayonets. Crazy bastards, Chris says in a shocked voice, and looks back to his men, all staring forward at the small group of men facing down a massive horde that is slowly shuffling towards them. I am death. I come for you. For every innocent man, woman and child you have taken, I come for you. For every life you have ruined, I come for you. For my parents you have already taken, I come for you. For my sister, who still lives, I come for you. I am death, and I come for you. I roar as the fury explodes out of me. I hear Dave unleash his anger, and his voice joins mine. And together, we roar our defiance and rage at these evil things. Behind me, I hear doors opening as the anger is released and comes forward for his payment, and together we stand and we scream at them. We draw breath, and we roar our rage into the air. I charge forward with my axe held out to my side. I charge at a solid wall of zombie undead who want to bite me, who want to kill me, but I am death, and I come for you all. Their teeth bear as one as we slam into them. Ten men against hundreds of vile creatures, but we have righteous glory on our side and we will not be defeated. Dave drops down and charges forward into the massed line, steaming through them and using sheer momentum to split them apart. The gap he created is filled by screaming recruits who pour into the front line, slashing, hacking and tearing flesh apart, roaring with anger, roaring with fear and driving forward. Bayonets slice through necks and split throats apart. Chest cavities are punctured again and again as the lads use the simple techniques shown to them by Dave. They work together and they work alone. 
Jamie has watched Dave fight and has taken to this new skill like a duck to water. His arms blur and wave through the air as he fights into the horde with desperate fury. I scream as my axe whirls, decapitating the first one in front of me. I lash out to the left and right, driving them back and embedding the sharp blade into their heads. Skulls are cleaved apart and brains burst out. But this isn't enough for me. Not by far. And I keep swinging as the glory of battle surges through my veins. Bodies drop in front of me, and the heavy blunt end does as much damage as the sharp blade as I bludgeon and shred them. Two line up for the lunge, and I take a massive swipe and cleave through the first neck and bite deep into the next one. The axe head jams into the spine, and I drive my forehead hard into the zombie's face and drop him down, leaving my axe free. I use the handle end to lash backwards into the nose of another one lunging at me, and I smash his face in. More are coming, but I want them to. I want all of them to come. I spin around with a huge strike and take out several at the same time, and I drive forward into a gap and turn to hack them from behind. Arms are torn off and legs are cut through as the bodies continue to fall. They must be fucking nuts, Chris says quietly, watching with horrified shock. Ten men against an army, Malcolm muses as he watches them hack the undead apart. Hardly seems fair, the big, bald-headed man says from behind them as he pulls the strap of the machine gun over his head and rests it down on the ground, then draws a massive knife from a sheath on his belt. More of the men take their weapons off and draw bladed and pointed weapons from various pockets. Chris watches them and feels the urge of battle calling. He slowly lowers his weapon and reaches behind him to draw two deadly-looking knives out. Watch the weapons. Chris stares hard at the truck driver, who stares back in absolute terror, but nods vigorously. The men start stalking forward rolling shoulder joints and twisting their necks to warm their muscles. Chris starts walking faster, and they all move to keep up. Chris starts jogging, and they all do. With a hundred metres to go, Chris turns to grin at Malcolm. Just like the old days, eh, mate? He doesn't wait for a response, but charges forward, screaming at the top of his voice. The others join him the experience of their age showing as they spread out into a line and charge into the fray. I hear screaming behind me and hack down the closest zombie to create space so I can turn. I look back to see Big Chris and his men charging towards the horde, rifles gone and all of them holding weapons to fight hand to hand. They roar as they strike and I feel a fresh surge of adrenaline rip through me. I scream out with a primeval roar and I hear my men, my warriors, take up the voice and join me. More voices join in and now we are not ten men. We are more and we will slaughter every one of you. We are death and we come for you. I swing the axe around with fresh energy and take them down. I split them apart and bodies fly before me. Dave is fighting off to my side and going deeper into the horde, and I fight my way towards him, savaging the creatures as they lunge for me. A strong uppercut and I cleave into the pelvis of one of them. I kick out and send him back to the hell he came from. I swipe out to my right and take another two down. We fight and we push forward and the bodies rack up behind us. I get to Dave's side and together we clear a small space. Blowers and Cookie burst through and join us in the slaughter. As our ground grows larger, Jamie Reese is next and doesn't hesitate as he plunges at the line of zombies encroaching on us. The recruits pile in until we are all in the small clearing. A loud roar sounds off to the side and I see the big, bald man charging through them with his head down, using his almighty size and strength to drive them apart. He bursts into the clearing, just as Big Chris and his men get through, until we are all there. We wait for a second, drawing breath. None of us speak, and we gather around in a tight circle, shoulder to shoulder. The undead gather around us and slowly inch forward, saliva drooling down their mouths. We wait for them to draw closer, and then, as one, we roar out and charge back at them. The circle is suddenly made much wider as the zombies fall back from the furious onslaught. We keep to the circle and let them come to us, 
We rip them apart as they step forward. Brains and bones are splintered onto the ground. Innards of stomachs fall out from the vicious stabs and slashes, and we work on in silence. This is our ground now. This small circle right here is our ground. It is holy and sacrosanct, and these evil demons spawned from the devil himself shall not touch it. You shall not live nor breathe the air in our circle while we hold it, and to the last man we shall fight you. The circle grows wider and wider as we slaughter them. They keep coming, but we move amongst the front line, keeping them in the rough, circular shape around us. Dave and some of Big Chris's men move beautifully with their knives and blades, experienced and tough. They do what their country told them to do. They do what their country demanded of them, and they did it without question. And, when the time came to return to normal life, they were the freaks and the killers that people avoided. Dave has always done what was required, and, despite all the glory and praise it brought him, he was alone in those battles. And he was alone when the fighting ended. But these men can now use those skills they honed for so long. They can use the skills and the tactics and the outright violence they were so encouraged to have. Throughout time, men have stood together in battle and they have fought for what they believed was right and proper. Now they fight for survival, to protect their loved ones and destroy this common enemy. The recruits fare well. Their youth, vitality and streetwise nature make up for their lack of knowledge and experience. But they have already proved they are capable by surviving in the plains through the first weekend. And now they just get better. I can now judge the amount of force needed and can preserve energy to sustain myself during the long minutes of battle. Fighting this way is a paradox. It seems to go on for hours, but then it's over in minutes and, one by one, we stand down and stagger backwards, chests heaving for air as we look about at the sheer devastation we have wrought. We have hacked them down until the road is clear and just one small group remain. Still they shuffle towards us, despite the huge losses brought to their kind. We look to one another to see who will go for them, but Dave is already there, dispatching them with cold efficiency slicing their throats open until the last one drops with blood spurting from his jugular. Then Dave drops down to wipe his knives on the bodies. I look around at the men, all of them covered in gore, with the undead's blood still dripping from their weapons. I look down at myself and see I am also covered in the filth. The road is clear now, I say to Chris, and start back towards the Saxon as the recruits slowly follow me. Chris and his men turn and walk back to their vehicles, each of them nodding respectfully towards us as they pass. Before long, we are driving again, the lads in the back cleaning themselves off with wipes. Fucking hell, Jamie, you took a few down then, McKinney says to the quiet lad, and I imagine him blushing furiously. He bloody did, well done, mate, blowers adds, and I know Jamie will now be extremely uncomfortable, but grinning back at them. Better than Cookie, anyway. I saw him trying to grope their asses instead of killing them, Blowers says. Fuck off, Blowers, I stab loads, Cookie retorts. Yeah, but not with your knife, though, Tucker cuts in to guffaws of laughter. Ah, oh, don't you start too, Tucker, Cookie groans. Feel better? Dave asks me. Yes, mate, much. You? Much better, Mr Howie, much better. Chapter 48 Through Darren's eyes, the infection sees the slow march of the undead shuffling towards the city in preparation for the resistors. The infection had made Darren feel sick as it penetrated into the body, and it knew that the others were becoming concerned, so it pulled back on the rate of infection and released hormone chemicals to make Darren feel well again. The infection watched through thousands of eyes as the vehicles went thundering past, and then they opened up with their tools to start cutting the host bodies down. Through Darren's ears it heard the thundering rattle of the machine gun on top of the vehicle, and at the same time it felt the bullets rip through the host bodies. The humans in the back then pushed the doors open and fired more bullets into the hosts. 
The infection watched and heard and felt this punishment cutting it down, and it had an almost overwhelming desire to unleash Darren now, but it knows he would be cut down instantly and serve no purpose. So it must wait, and let him do as the others do. Darren takes his turn at the rear doors, and the infection feels the pressure of a hand gripping Darren from behind. It feels as Darren holds the weapon and looks down the sights at the passing undead, and it feels Darren apply pressure to the trigger, and then the weapon kicking in his hands. The infection feels the gun firing at the same time as it watches the vehicle thunder past, and then it feels the bullets striking the hosts. The infection can see, hear and feel all of these things at the same time from the thousands of hosts in that area. The infection watches with interest as the hosts are cut down, and it knows that the road ahead is already blocked by the hosts it has sent into the city. As the Saxon comes to a halt and the firing stops, the infection watches the one they call Howie through the eyes of Darren. It allows Darren to be himself, and he feels adrenaline coursing through his system, and Darren knows that Howie wants to fight them in person. The infection observes Howie turn and stare back at the resistors, and it feels the nervous energy, fear and thirst for vengeance flood through Darren, a marvellous mixture of chemicals that cause a massive reaction. The small one's voice booms out, and the infection hears it from hundreds of points and turns the host horde to face them. The resistors line up and roar defiantly at them, and the infection is absorbed at the feeling of Darren roaring and his system flooding with rage, fury, fear and adrenaline. Then they charge. Through the eyes of the hosts and through the eyes of Darren, the infection watches the two come together and can feel Darren fight with fury and power, using his body as a tool to cut the hosts down. The infection is appalled at the losses it suffers, but also thrilled to be watching this happen and can see now how slow the hosts are and how easy they are to cut down. The infection watches Howie, Dave and all of them work, and it feels the pain of each blow, but it watches and it learns. These resistors call to each other, just as the infection makes the hosts do as night falls. But this noise they send to each other causes more of the chemicals to be released in Darren's body and drives him to work harder and faster and generate more power with each swipe, thrust and cut. The hosts are cut down until just a few are left and the infection watches with cold detachment as the small one slaughters those few precious remaining hosts. It feels the exhaustion flood through Darren's body and it knows that it could release different chemicals to make this feeling go away. But by doing so, it would draw unwanted attention from these humans, so it stays almost dormant and it watches as they get further into the city. Chapter 49 Sarah slowly gets dressed, feeling dizzy and light-headed as the after-effects of so much alcohol purge from her system. Last night saw an explosion of emotions, anger, hurt, loss, isolation, fear and desperation. But today she feels flat and numb, void of emotion, with a dull headache and an upset stomach. In a way, she feels a bit better, drained but somewhat relieved that those emotions came out. Despite the heavy drinking and crying, she coped with them and is still here. She could have plunged to her death from the balcony, or cut her wrists or run crying through the corridors, screaming for someone to help her. But she didn't. She remained in her apartment and kept to herself. After dressing, she walks through the lounge to the kitchen, and instead of her normal method of putting her hand into the cupboard with tins and taking the first one she touches, she opens the doors and looks through the selection, choosing fruit salad, canned meat and small potatoes. Today, she needs sustenance and fuel to help her think a way out of this. The time for depression and self-pity is over. Now is a time for action. Chapter 50 The convoy drives further into London, going past well-known places and delving further into the grotty inner city areas. These places were rough already before the event, The red brick of Victorian England mixes with the greys and browns of post-war Britain, 
urban decay with millions of people living hard lives in one of the world's fastest moving cities. New buildings of glass and steel, sporadically placed, only serve to make the rest look like the grimy places that have come to be. There was constant civil disorder here before, caused by huge numbers of disaffected young people left with a weak education system, a poor social structure and zero employment opportunities. People who were left to grow in an area that didn't want or need them and didn't know what to do with them. Undead zombies slowly shuffle through the streets and roads, all of them still heading in the same direction as the convoy, but instead of the open main roads, they use side streets, drawn from the memories of host locals, although the team doesn't know this. Howie drives the Saxon with Dave next to him, and both of them peer out of the toughened glass at the passing streets. The battle left all of them tired, and even the boastful laughing of the recruits soon drifts into silence as they each clean their weapons and clothing from the gore and spattered blood. The convoy passes over the distinctive red and yellow curves of Vauxhall Bridge and the famous River Thames sliding slowly underneath. A tourist boat has broken free of its moorings and has drifted down to rest against the high walls, its sides scraping along the concrete embankment. We're over the River Thames, Howie calls out as the lads move forward to see out of the windscreen at the grey-blue water. Ah, I'd like to swim in there. It looks inviting, Tucker says with a sigh, sweating heavily from the heat. A swim would be fucking lovely, McKinney answers. I wouldn't swim in that filth, Cookie calls out. Probably get bitten by a mutant turd, he adds, to sniggers from the others. They cross the bridge and head into the main road on the other side, travelling through Lambeth towards Tower Bridge. There's shitloads of them again, Howie says to Dave, looking at the long queues of zombies walking along the same route. Get Jamie on the GPMG to start cutting them down, Howie calls out. Alpha to all units, large numbers in front, opening fire on them now, Dave speaks into the radio. Charlie to Alpha, roger that. Are you sure you don't want another knife fight instead? Big Chris asks, and Howie smiles broadly. Jamie opens up on the GPMG, firing into the long, drawn-out queues of zombies. It's like culling, really, Howie remarks. What is? Dave asks. Shooting them like this. Why is it like culling? We're reducing their numbers, culling the density of them. Oh, the more we get now, the less we have to deal with later. Or the angrier they will get, Dave replies. Speaking of angry, did I see you a bit angry back then? A little, Dave admits. A little? You look like a lot to me. Jamie's doing well. He is. He takes after you. Do you think so? Dave asks. Oh, no doubt. Did you see him with the two knives? Yes. Who do you think he learnt that from? Well, I guess from me. No guessing needed, mate. He is now Mini Dave. But he's got some skills, though. He moves well, just needs to plan ahead a bit more and hone his use of force. Show him, then, Howie says. OK, Mr Howie. You still like the axe, then? No, I love the axe. Knives are too fiddly for me. I like the power and strength of the axe. Like a Viking. Yeah, I'm going to grow a big beard and put plaits in it and have a horned helmet. Speaking of axes, Dave points out of the window to a row of shops, one of them clearly a large DIY and garden store. Does anyone want an axe? Howie shouts out jokingly, but here's a chorus of approval. Seriously? Howie asks. I want an axe. I'm no good with the knife and the rifle feels, I don't know... It feels too cumbersome, Nick shouts out. Dave, let them know we're having a quick pit stop and someone shout up to Jamie about the plan. Dave speaks into the radio as Howie slows the Saxon down. Jamie concentrates his fire on the undead that are anywhere near the DIY store, cutting them to pieces and clearing some space. Right, let's be quick, Howie shouts as he jumps out of the vehicle. Those not going for a new weapon, make a cordon round the vehicles. Dave calls out as he gets down and holds his assault rifle at the ready. The truck pulls up behind them, and after a few minutes, Big Chris and his men are stepping over the bloody bodies and walking towards the Saxon. 
What's going on? Chris calls out. Mr Howie and a few of the lads are getting some handheld weapons, Dave replies and nods to the DIY store. Lads, if you need anything, you've got five minutes, Chris says to a few of his men, who oblige with smiles. The DIY store door gets kicked in by joint, choreographed kicks from Howie and blowers, and soon bursts open in a shower of glass. The lads pile in and all start heading towards the hand tool section. What about a sledgehammer? Cookie calls out. Tried it. Not bad, but it's very heavy and gets tiring after a few minutes, Howie replies. I tried two lump hammers as well, but their range is too short. The chainsaw was good, but it was petrol driven and ran out of juice too soon, he explains, and realises that everyone has stopped to stare at him. What? he asks defensively as they turn back to the shelves. He finds the axe section first and starts looking through the racks. Oh my, look at this beauty, Howie whispers to himself as he pulls off a long-handled axe with a double-bladed end, each blade covered with a leather sheath. It suits you. Howie looks up to see the massive bald-headed man standing next to him, staring at the axe. Do you think so? Howie asks. Oh yes, very you, the man mountain nods firmly. There's another one left if you want it, Howie says, pulling the last of the double-bladed axes from the section and handing it over to the big man. Oh, that feels nice, he says appreciatively, weighing it in his giant hand. The single-bladed axe was good with the sharp end and the blunt end, but this is much better, Howie says, admiring the metal blades. I've always been a knife man myself, the big man says, but I saw you with the axe back there and I thought that I've got to try one. They are good. I tried the knives, but I lack the precision and finesse they need. I like the power of slamming them down with these things, Howie says. Yes, I can see what you mean. Tell me, do you use a constant swiping action or more of a chop, he asks. Well, it depends on the situation. A good swipe will clear space and take a few down, but a solid chop down into the head is lovely. Even better, if you chop or slice down, it's the uppercut into the groin, but the head can bite into the bone and get caught, Howie explains, going through the motions of the swipe, chop and uppercut as he describes. Ah, yeah, I can see that. I suppose a foot into the stomach pushes them off then, he asks. Yeah, that does it. A big guy like yourself could do some awesome damage with one, Howie says. To be honest, I've always wanted to try it, but the army would get a bit funny if we all started carrying them around with us, I reckon. Yeah, I can see that, Howie says. Bloody hell, are there any more of them left? Blowers asks. No, sorry mate, we got the last two. Plenty of the single-bladed ones, though. Don't dismiss them. I was just saying that the blunt end can do a good amount of damage too, Howie explains, as Blowers pulls them out and hands them around to the others. Do you keep the end covered all the time? The big man asks. Not really. I clean it after each fight, and I know Dave keeps a knife sharpener, and he sharpens it for me, Howie answers. Right, good point. The men all stand in the aisle, taking practice swings and commenting on each other's pose and grip, until Big Chris enters to stand in the doorway. When you lot have finished fucking about, he shouts out. Sorry, mate. My fault. Just getting a new axe, Howie says, as they all start to leave, carrying long-handled axes back out into the sunshine. Soon, the Saxon, leading the convoy, heads off towards Tower Bridge. The convoy continues along the main road, going through the Elephant and Castle roundabout and off towards Tower Bridge Road. The exodus, or invasion, of zombies is even more prevalent on the road to the bridge, with massive numbers stretched back in solid lines seven or eight deep. The general-purpose machine gun does a good job of cutting them down, but the thickness of the lines means many on the inside escape uninjured and continue on their slow shuffle. Charlie to Alpha. The radio crackles in Dave's hand. Alpha receiving. Go ahead, Charlie. Charlie to Alpha. This area looks too hot for RV. I suggest we move to a quiet side street. You choose. Roger that, Charlie. Stand by, Dave answers. This place is crawling with them, Howie mutters, but loud enough to be heard over the constant thumping of the machine gun above them. 
Over there, sir. Blowers points, leaning forward to indicate a side street with a constant stream of zombies going past the entrance. The Saxon slows down, and Howie peers over to see that the road looks wide enough to take the truck, but is quiet enough to move down. We'll go through here. Get Jamie to stop for now, Howie calls out, and the machine gun ceases firing as Cookie yells up. Alpha to Charlie. Side street identified. Moving in now. Dave reports to the others as Howie turns the wheel and ploughs through the lines of undead. The solid front end of the Saxon easily squashes some and shoves the rest out of the way. Bloody hell, they didn't even slow down, Howie shouts as he looks in the side mirror to see the zombies still slowly marching forward, not breaking pace to turn or look. The Saxon is followed by the truck and then the two four-wheel drive vehicles. They proceed a safe distance down the quiet street and finally pull over. Blowers, get some lads out front and to the sides, mate, Howie asks as he drops down from the cabin and walks back along to meet Chris and the others. Will do, Blowers calls out as he and the recruits pile out of the back and spread out as directed. They meet near the front of the truck, Big Chris, Malcolm, Howie and Dave. A few of the others are standing nearby, but clearly distancing themselves from the immediate group. That bridge will be full up, Malcolm says, rubbing the back of his neck. We can get through them easily enough, Howie replies. We can, but there are thousands heading that way. They seem to know where we're going, and I don't like that fact one bit, Big Chris says. How can they know? Malcolm asks, and they both look to Howie, who shrugs back at them. I don't know. It seemed like they were coming for us last night at the surfaces, too. Like we were being targeted, but I don't know how, Howie says, thinking hard. Unless they're going into the city for something else, Malcolm asks. Not likely. Every time we've met any hordes, they turn and come for us. These aren't doing that. They're intent on getting somewhere. This could get very messy if we're anywhere near this place at sunset, Howie replies. We can get through them, no problem, but then we have to stop at the hospital with this lot still coming behind us. Even the GPMG can't cut that many down, and we don't know how many are coming from other directions, Chris says. What choice do we have? Howie asks. Lift the bridge, Dave says quietly. Lift the bridge? Howie asks. Of course! Tower Bridge lifts. We could raise it up after us, Malcolm says excitedly. How will we do that? Does it need power? Do you know how the controls work? Howie asks, liking the idea. Mate, we were power reg, Malcolm smiles. It must have a separate power supply in case of blackout or something, and the controls can't be too complicated, Chris muses, rubbing his chin. So we get across and then work out how to raise it to stop this lot getting across. Then we just have to worry about the rest on the other side, Howie says, looking between them all. Yep, that's about the size of it, Chris nods. Okay, where do you want us? Howie asks. Keep the Saxon at the end of the bridge on the other side to keep them back while we work out how to get the thing lifted with the truck behind the Saxon, Chris says. Are you leaving a unit there? So we can drop it again for the egress, Dave asks. I think we'll need everyone for the hospital and then Howie's sister, Chris replies. Okay, Dave says. Everyone happy? Chris asks, looking between them all, as they nod and depart back to the vehicles. The vehicles all move off and follow the side streets around until they come back out onto Tower Bridge Road, again using the front of the Saxon to mow down the chain of zombies trudging across the junction. The last stretch of road brings the bridge into view, the massive towers rising up high into the blue sky. Hold off on the GPMG until we get across. We'll be wasting ammo if we can get that bridge lifted, Howie calls back, and hears the machine gun stop suddenly. Who's going to lift the bridge, Mr Howie? Nick Hewitt shouts out. I don't know, one of the others, Howie replies. Why, do you fancy a go? he adds, remembering Nick's passion for mechanical and electrical things. I'd love to, Nick shouts back. The Saxon powers through the middle of the road, entering the bridge, 
The road is so clogged with zombies, the Saxon has no choice but to plough through them, sending them scattering off to the sides. Still, the zombies keep dead ahead, and none of them turn to look or alter course. This is fucking freaky, Cookie says in the quietness of the Saxon. It ain't right, is it? McKinney responds. Why aren't they turning or doing anything else? They're just heading the same way as us, Tucker says. It's eerie. They must know something we don't. This from Darren Smith. You feeling better now, Smithy? Howie calls out on hearing his voice. Yes, thank you, Mr Howie. Much better. Guess I was just tired. Or had a bit of head stroke or something, Darren replies. Or cock stroke in Cookie's case, Blower says. What? How do you make that connection? Cookie exclaims. Smithy's talking about heat stroke and you turn it round to a gay joke? He shakes his head. Just comes naturally, mate. Either got it or you haven't, Blower says in a modest voice. You're a prat. Tucker, you got anything to eat, mate? I'm starving, Cookie asks. Yes, mate, I got loads of stuff from that services shop. Tucker pulls out a carrier bag and hands it around as the lads dig in for snacks. Be quick, lads, we're almost there, Howie shouts as he hears packets being ripped open and loud munching noises. The Saxon roars over the central part, between the towers and through to the north side, pulling to a halt where the normal road joins the bridge. Clear the area and keep them off the bridge, Howie shouts as he jumps down with his assault rifle. The lads spread out and open fire on the undead as they continue to proceed off the bridge, still heading towards the city. Despite the firing and the stationary positions, none of the zombies turn or change direction, but continue onwards, away from the bridge. The truck pulls behind them and Howie glances back to see the four-wheel drive vehicle stopping by a structure on the bridge with glass windows going round it. That must be the control room, Howie shouts to Dave as the recruits fire into the backs of the zombies. The end of the bridge is cleared and the lads all turn and start on the oncoming zombies that are streaming down the bridge towards them. Charlie to Alpha, we're at the control room but it's going to take longer than we thought. Alpha to Charlie, receive the last, do you need support? Dave answers. Negative, they're just going straight past us, not even looking. It's very weird. Dave, tell them I'm coming up with Nick, Howie shouts. Nick, you're with me in the Saxon. The two of them jump in and drive the short distance back to the control room, the zombies shuffling around them without so much as a glance. This is fucked up, Mr Howie, what's going on? Nick asks. I don't know, mate, Howie replies as the Saxon comes to a halt. They get out, readying themselves to fight through zombies, but none of them stop, look or even bare their teeth as Howie and Nick stand and watch them. Howie reaches out and pushes one on the shoulder, forcing him to stagger off to the side and knock into several others. Nothing, Howie says as the zombie just continues on its path. They fucking stink, Nick says, covering his nose at the stench of decaying flesh. They run over to the side, weaving through zombies but still being guarded in case they turn and attack, and they eventually find their way to the control room. Some of the armed men from the four-wheel drive vehicles are standing outside, vigilantly watching the hordes shuffle past. Bloody hell, that's a lot of buttons, Howie says as he gets inside and looks at the complicated array of switches on the control panel. Nick's eyes light up and he rushes forward to start examining them. This is awesome, he says quietly as he looks over the panel. It's more complicated than we thought, Big Chris says to Howie. Just give him a few minutes, Howie motions to Nick who is absorbed, muttering to himself. I can't believe they haven't turned on us, Howie says, looking out at the zombies going past. Something's not right, Malcolm says. Maybe that's it. They've given up and stopped eating people, Howie jokes. The awkward silence that follows is only broken by Nick's loud exclamation. You got something, mate? Howie asks, relieved by the distraction. Yep, got it. There's a power supply and a series of safety switches that have to be done in the right order before the hydraulics start lifting the bridge, Nick says excitedly. Bloody kids, too much Xbox if you ask me, Malcolm jokes. Right, you ready Mr Howie? Nick asks, and Howie feels a touch of pride at being asked instead of Big Chris or Malcolm. 
Yes, mate. Go ahead. Nick presses and flips a series of switches, then starts pulling back on a small black lever. An alarm sounds outside, and the bridge starts to lift smoothly, separating in the middle as both sides lift. The action is surprisingly quick, and the men watch as zombies start staggering faster as the bridge lifts. Then gravity takes over and they start tumbling into the backs of each other, causing a concertina effect as the momentum picks up. The men smile and laugh as the zombies are sent plummeting down onto the road surface. The other side are still walking off the edge, Nick laughs, watching a number of black and white monitors above the control panel. The men wait for a minute as some of the zombies pick themselves up and start their shuffling again. Many stay on the ground in a tangled mess of arms and legs. Before long, the hordes have shuffled off down the bridge and the men leave the control room to slowly walk behind them. If this keeps on, we'll have an easy time at the hospital and then going for your sister, Big Chris says, as he stops by the door of his four-wheel drive. I bloody hope so, Howie replies. But knowing what seems to happen to us every half hour, I very much doubt it, he adds, before walking back to the Saxon with Nick. Chapter 51 The infection pushes the hosts towards the city, using roads, streets and the underground rail network. Zombies pour down the steps onto the platforms and drop down onto the inert rail lines, shuffling through the darkened tunnels to emerge closer to their destination. Never has London seen such a densely packed crowd before, all moving as one without aggravation. No fights or pushing and shoving, just undead bodies, all being told to move to this location as they slowly pile into Canary Wharf and the surrounding streets, until every inch of pavement and tarmac is covered. The bodies still have the craving for flesh, but this is overcome as they move slowly past Howie and the resistors. The temptation to turn and lunge for the bite is almost too much to control, but the infection holds them back and waits. It knows how the resistors can fight back now, and unless the numbers are overwhelming, the hosts can be cut down too easily. On the bridge, the infection almost decides to make the host bodies move fast and go for the attack, but the big vehicles are nearby, with one of the resistors sitting on that devastating machine gun. So it keeps to plan and waits for them to come. Chapter 52 Sarah finishes her meal and drinks plenty of water to rehydrate after the heavy drinking the night before. Then she carefully fills her pots, pans and receptacles while the water supply still works, thinking there must be a massive tank at the top of the building to keep a building that size supplied. Dressed in jeans and a t-shirt with her hair pulled back, she looks serious and determined. Determined to do something to help her situation, but not knowing what that should be. She opens the patio doors and steps out onto the balcony and takes a sharp intake of breath as she looks down. There had been crowds of them on the road and pavement below, but now the whole area is covered in them. The street below her is packed and she can see into side streets further up and the junctions at the end of the road. There are undead bodies packed in like sardines, shuffling and rippling like one giant snake. The intense heat and stillness of the air sends putrid and fetid odours wafting up on the thermals created by the packed bodies, and Sarah almost gags as she covers her face and mouth with her hand. The stench of the decomposing bodies is awful, and she imagines the skin hanging off and maggots writhing in the open wounds. The strong sense of purpose and determination ebbs away as she realises there is no way out of the building. The sheer amount of them could push through the main front doors with ease if they put their zombie minds to it. And she steps back as she suddenly realises they could be at her door within minutes if they chose. She slowly pushes the patio doors closed and realises that from her position on the balcony she can't see the main doors and they could already be inside now. She creeps over to her front door and rests her ear against the cool wood, intently listening for any noises there is only silence. Chapter 53 Charlie to Alpha. Alpha receiving. Go ahead, Charlie. 
We have identified a secondary route using side roads. Slow down and let us take the lead from here. Roger that, Charlie. Slowing down now for you to take lead position. The four-wheel drive vehicle pulls out from behind the truck and shoots past the slowing vehicles, slotting in front of the Saxon. The men in the rear of the vehicle look back and nod to Howie and Dave in the front. Howie nods back and raises his hands as Dave keeps scanning the area. Bloody hell, this is packed with them, Howie says. It is, Mr Howie, Dave replies. And it's getting worse the further we go in. It is. Here we go, Howie says as the four-wheel drive turns a sharp left, mowing down several undead crossing the junction and sending the bodies spinning off. The rest keep going across as the Saxon takes a turn to run some over. They don't know the Green Cross Code, do they? Howie says. The what? Dave asks. The Green Cross Code. What's that? You've never heard of it? Everyone knows the Green Cross Code, Howie says. I don't, Dave replies flatly. Lads, you've heard of the Green Cross Code, haven't you? Howie calls out. What's that? Voices shout from the back. Well, you're all just youngsters, really. You must have heard it from school, Dave. No, Mr Howie, Dave answers. What did they say as they taught you to cross the road then, Howie asks. Look left and right, Dave answers. Well, yeah, but what about the big bloke in the cape? Superman, Dave asks. No, he had a green cape, I think. Superman had a red cape, Mr Howie. I know that Superman had a red cape. I meant the green cross code man. He had a green cape, I think. I don't know him, Dave says. No, hang on. He didn't have a cape. He had a white top with big shoulder pads and a big green cross on his chest, Howie says, looking across at Dave, who shakes his head. The Green Lantern wears green, Dave says. Yes, I know he does, but I'm on about the Green Cross Code Man. The Incredible Hulk was green too, Dave adds. I know, but he isn't the one I'm on about, Howie says. The Incredible Hulk? I never liked him that much, Tucker says, leaning forward to join the conversation. Why not? Dave asks. I was always into Batman, Tucker says. Early Batman or late Batman? Curtis Graves cuts in. Oh, it has to be early Batman, Tucker replies. No way, the last Batman movies were the best, Curtis replies. Batman didn't wear green, Dave adds. Spider-Man's the best one, Cookie says, leaning forward too. Yeah, I like Spider-Man, but I never liked spiders, so they always put me off him, Tucker replies. Spider-Man didn't wear green either, Dave says. Iron Man was the best, Hewitt shouts out. He wasn't a superhero, he was a normal bloke in a special outfit, Tucker replies. Well, Batman was then too, Curtis says. No, Batman had special powers, Tucker says. No, he didn't. He was just a normal bloke who did loads of training, Curtis retorts. The Thing from the Fantastic Four was my favourite, McKinney calls out. The Human Torch was the best one, Blowers joins in. They didn't wear green, Dave says. The Green Cross Code Man wore green, Howie says. Mr Fantastic was way better than either of them, Curtis replies. You're telling me that being a bit bendy, like Cookie, is better than being able to burst into flames, Blowers asks indignantly. What can you do with fire other than make things hot? Curtis asks. Well, you can set things on fire for a start, Blowers says. And? Cookie asks. That's cool enough, Blowers says defensively. I've got a plastic lighter in my pocket that can do that, Hewitt says. Yeah, well, he could move fast too, Blowers shouts. So would I if I was on fire all the bloody time, Tucker laughs. I like Wonder Woman. Jamie Reese joins in to a stunned silence from the rest. She was bloody gorgeous. Yeah, fair one, I would, Blowers agrees, as most of the lads nod. Fair point, mate, she was crumpet, Cookie says. She didn't wear green, Dave says. Have you got a favourite one, Dave? Cookie asks. Yes, he replies. Who? Howie asks. Wolverine. <laughs> that figures, Howie says, as all the lads nod in agreement. 
Is that the hospital? He adds, as they come onto a wide road leading to a large, modern-looking building. Yes, Dave replies, as the large sign saying Canary Wharf Hospital comes into view. Yeah, thanks for that, Dave, Howie says. The access road leading to the hospital is long and goes around the back of a large visitor's car park with a surprising number of cars still parked there. The access road then leads on and curves off into large ambulance bays outside a set of immense double doors. Charlie to all units, we're going with Bravo to the side entrance to gain access as directed by Doc Roberts. Alpha, you cover the front unless we call for help. Delta, you check the rear and then go to the far side. The units all respond with affirmations, and the four-wheel drive vehicle and the truck drive on down the access road and bear left, disappearing down the side. The Saxon pulls up tight to the front of the building. Can you ask Darren if he's got a good view from up there, or does he need it moved? Howie asks, and hears Darren reply that he can see fine. Right, lads, spread out across the entrance here and keep a good eye out, Howie says. Where are they all? Tucker asks, leaning forward to look out of the windscreen. I don't know, mate. I guess this is off the main road or the centre or wherever they're going, but it won't take them long if they want us, Howie replies, and gets out of the vehicle with his assault rifle, checking his webbing belt pouches for magazines. The recruits climb out from the rear doors and start moving out to form a wide line spread across the front, facing out onto the main road. You like that sniper rifle then? Howie asks Jamie as he walks down the line, checking the lads are all okay. Jamie has the rifle up and is looking through the scope, down towards the building line, the SA-80 strapped to his back. Yes, Mr Howie, Jamie answers. You're getting very good with it too, mate, Howie says. Thanks, Mr Howie. You'll be giving Dave a run for his money soon, mate, especially if you carry on like that with the double knives. Oh, do you want me to just use one, or the bayonet on the rifle instead? Jamie asks, concerned. No, no, mate, it was a compliment. Even Dave said how well you did with them, Howie says, as Jamie blushes bright red and stammers a thank you. Howie walks down to the end and stands next to Dave. It's very quiet, Mr Howie, Dave says in hushed tones. Oh, you've said it now, Howie groans. Charlie to Alpha, multiple contacts inside, request immediate reinforcements, we're on the second floor at the rear of the building. Chris's voice booms out, the sound of gunshots loud in the background. See what I mean? You had to say it, didn't you? Howie admonishes jokingly. Blowers, you hold out here. I'll take Jamie, McKinney and Dave with me. We've only got one radio, so stay safe and get back inside the Saxon if it gets too much, Howie calls out. Yes, sir. Blowers answers as Jamie and McKinney rush over towards the front doors to join Dave and Howie. Jamie and Dave at the front, as you're the best shots. Me and McKinney will go behind and cover the rear, uh, if that's okay with you, Dave. That's fine, Mr Howie, Dave answers respectfully. Okay, let's go, Howie says as they push the doors open and enter. Use the rifle for now, but be prepared to swap for the assault weapon if it gets hot. Single shot to the head and watch out for our guys. Dave advises Jamie as they take the lead and start moving down the wide central corridor and past the reception desk. The interior already looks looted, with debris littered everywhere and dried bloodstains smeared down the polished and gleaming floor of the new hospital. Waiting room chairs are strewn about and the contents of the desks look to have been thrown out into the main room. Looks like someone tried to fight them off, Howie remarks as they step around the items on the floor. Dave pauses and raises a hand up in the air, first in a clenched fist and then with one finger raised, then points off to the side. Oh no, not this again, Howie mutters, as they pass the area where Dave was indicating and see a dead body halfway out of a toilet door. The face is bitten away and a large pool of congealed blood is under the head. They walk quickly down the central corridor, passing doors and waiting areas on both sides, Signs hang from the ceiling, giving directions to the various departments. As they get towards the rear of the building, they hear the sound of muffled gunshots and start moving faster. Dave and Jamie walk in front, Dave with his assault rifle raised to his shoulder and Jamie with the sniper rifle. Howie and McKinney keep scanning to the sides and checking the rear as they progress quickly but quietly. 
The sniper rifle coughs as Jamie sweeps quickly to the right and a zombie falls out of a concealed side corridor, the back of his head blown away. Jamie racks the bolt quickly and continues moving forward, hardly breaking stride. Two more shuffle around from the end of the corridor towards them and are quickly dispatched by a single shot to the head each. The quiet noise of the sniper rifle suppressor is deadened by the loud retort of the assault rifle fired by Dave. The zombies are both blown backwards as the four men keep stepping forward to the end of the corridor and identify the stairwell doors. Dave enters first, sweeping up the stairs with his rifle aimed high, then takes each step carefully, but still moving with speed. Clear, he says quietly, but clearly as the others follow him to the door, leading onto the second floor. Dave and Jamie pause for a second at the double doors, as Dave pushes gently to test they open inwards. He nods to Jamie and indicates for him to check right, and he will check left, then turns to show Howie and McKinney to cover the front. Then Dave nods, and he and Jamie push the doors open quickly and burst out into the corridor. Dave turns immediately to face left and Jamie to the right. Howie and McKinney step forward to the long corridor facing them, and the several undead shuffling in the other direction. They both open fire using single shots, dropping the zombies in the back, and Howie hears both Dave and Jamie firing. Once the corridor ahead is clear, Howie looks across to see Jamie and Dave have both dropped several undead each. Alpha to Charlie, we are on the second floor at the rear stairwell. Confirm your location, Dave says into the radio. Charlie to Alpha, we've got most of them down. Hold there until we make our way back to you, Chris answers. Roger that. Holding position at the rear stairwell doors on the second floor. The four of them hold position, occasionally firing as a zombie appears from one of the many side entrances that branch off. Eventually, they hear banging noises from the corridor ahead of Howie and McKinney. Charlie to Alpha, we are approaching your position now. Be aware, be aware. Roger that, Charlie. Acknowledged. The noises increase as Big Chris and several of his men run into view from a side entrance, each of them carrying large items and boxes in their hands, their weapons strapped across their backs or shoulders. There were loads of them up there, Chris shouts as they draw closer. You all okay? Howie asks. Yeah, no injuries. Bloody close call, though. We went into a wrong room and it was packed, I mean fucking packed with them. They couldn't get out until we opened the bloody doors, and then they just started pouring out of everywhere, Chris answers as they stop by the stairwell doors. Did you get everything? Howie asks. Nope, we have a load more to get yet. Can we borrow two of your blokes to cover us while we carry this lot out? Big Chris asks. Dave, do you want to go with Jamie? Me and McKinney can wait here. Okay, Mr Howie. Dave answers as he and Jamie go down the stairwell ahead of the group, leaving McKinney and Howie on the second floor. Several minutes pass in silence as they wait for the group to come back. Looks like they got them all, Howie mutters. Yeah. Um, would you mind if I had a smoke, Mr Howie? McKinney asks politely. Smoking in a hospital? You'll get in trouble for that, mate, Howie jokes. Oh, okay, I can wait, McKinney answers. I was joking, mate. Crack on if you want. Thanks. Do you want one? He offers, and Howie is very tempted, despite having stopped smoking before the zombie invasion. No thanks, mate. If I start now, I will never bloody stop, and I'm already too unfit for all this running about, Howie says, willpower winning over temptation. McKinney lights up, and Howie smells the smoke wafting over, further tempting him. They hear the others coming up the stairs. Smoking in a hospital, you'll get in trouble for that, Big Chris calls out as he walks off. That's what I said, Howie mutters quietly, and waits in position until they come back past them again, carrying equipment and boxes. I think it's pretty clear up here now. How's the front? Chris asks as he moves past them again. Quiet when we left. No sign of them anywhere near us, Howie answers. Darren Smith grips the GPMG from his position as lookout on the Saxon, slowly moving left to right, looking for movement. He is completely unaware of the infection inside him, alerting all the hosts in the area to their location. The main road runs left to right beyond the car park in front of them, and the building line is beyond the road. Big, tall office blocks are mostly joined together to form a continuous line, but some walkways, alleys and side streets connect the main road to the hospital area. 
Blowers, Cookie, Graves, Tucker and Hewitt are stretched out in a line across the entrance, smoking cigarettes while watching the perimeter. They're taking a while, Cookie calls over to Blowers. Probably had to get a load of stuff, Blowers replies. Contact, Darren shouts from behind them. Where, Smithy? Blowers shouts back as they all start looking more intently. Building line, small alley off to the left, he shouts back as a single adult undead slowly emerges from the shade. There's only one of them, Hewitt calls out. Who wants him? Blowers offers. Let me try for a headshot, Cookie says as he raises his assault rifle and aims down the sights. You'll never get him from this distance, Hewitt says as Cookie pauses for a few seconds, then slowly squeezes the trigger. The rifle fires and the bullet flies through the air straight at the zombie and straight past him, going into the wall a few feet beyond. Ah, fuck it, Cookie says as the rest start laughing. Let me try, Hewitt calls out and repeats the same action as Cookie, aiming at the shuffling zombie's head and firing after a few seconds' pause. Ha, <laughs> you fucking losers, Blowers laughs as the shot misses. I'll show you how it's done. Blowers takes a few seconds to line the shot up, then fires the rifle, the bullet just clipping the zombie on his upper arm, making him spin around and bang into the wall behind him. I fucking got him, Blowers exclaims. No, he didn't, he's still coming, Darren shouts over as the zombie turns back towards them and continues shuffling. My turn, Tucker says, and lines the zombie's head up between the sights and fires. The round strikes the zombie in the centre of the forehead and the back of his skull explodes in a pink cloud as he slumps backwards onto the ground. Fucking hell, Tucker, well done, mate, Hewitt shouts out. Did you bloody see that? Tucker's mouth drops open as he lowers the rifle and looks over at the others. Good shot, mate, Blowers says. He was a lot closer, though, Cookie adds. Fuck off. He was shuffling slowly. He did about four steps in total, and he got knocked back by Blower's shot, Tucker shouts. No, he was a lot closer. Almost halfway, I'd say, Hewitt joins in, laughing. He fucking was not. He was still in the same place, Tucker yells back, offended. They're joking, mate. It was an awesome shot, Blower says. Even if he was a lot closer, he adds. Oh, piss off, you wankers, Tucker pouts. Oh shit, to the right, Darren shouts, alarmed, as a massed horde starts shuffling into view, coming from a side street to the right. That's a lot of zombies, Cookie mutters, looking at the front of the thick horde. Left side too, Darren shouts again, and the lads look to see another horde coming out of a side street. Main road to the right, Darren shouts again as another huge horde comes into view on the road they had just driven along a few minutes ago. This is going to get interesting, Blower says. Let's pull back a bit so we're out of the firing line, he says, and they pull back towards the Saxon. That's enough, lads, Darren calls out when he's sure he can fire at the hordes over the top of them. Oh well, best get on with it then, Smithy. You take that lot on the road to the right, we'll take the other side street to the right. They're both closer than the left side. OK, mate, Darren says, and turns the heavy machine gun to face into the horde and opens up on them. The GPMG bursts to life, spewing rounds into the front of the horde who start dropping instantly. Blowers and the rest start firing single shots into the front of the horde coming from the right side street. The effect is less dramatic than the GPMG, but they still start to wither away at the front of the horde. The infection watches simultaneously through Darren's eyes and the eyes of the hosts as they start towards the resistors. The weapons are doing their deadly work already, and many hosts are being cut down. The infection has the whole area packed with undead hosts, but the losses are too great already, and it knows they will be cut to shreds before they get anywhere near the hospital. Fuck me, they're moving faster, Blower shouts, unheard over the constant firing of the machine gun behind him and the assault rifles to both sides. The hordes have suddenly increased their pace, not by much, but there is a definite increase from the slow shuffling to an almost normal walking pace. Fuck it, they're getting faster, Cookie yells out. I just said that, Blowers shouts back as they continue to fire into the hordes, and instead of picking their shots carefully, they now fire directly into the front of the crowd, hoping that any shot will drop them or slow them down enough to buy time. 
Inside the hospital at the rear stairwell on the second floor, the thick walls and dividing rooms suppress the sounds of firing from the front of the building. Howie and McKinney hold their position, waiting for the others to load more equipment and medicines into the truck. I never liked hospitals, McKinney remarks. A lot of people don't, mate, Howie replies. Too clean and sterile and full of sick people. True, but where else should the sick people go? Howie asks. I spent ages in them when my mum got sick. Different hospitals all over the place, McKinney says. What was wrong with her? Howie asks. Heart problems. She died a few months ago, McKinney says, quietly. Oh, mate, I'm really sorry about that, Howie says. Thanks, Mr Howie. It was probably for the best. Got to be better than going out in all this mess and turning into one of them. Yeah, maybe. Still, tough thing to have to deal with, though. Yeah, Dad didn't cope very well. Started drinking a lot and just went downhill, McKinney says in a soft voice. That's awful, mate, but I guess grief will do that. Yeah, I guess, McKinney replies. How do you think the others are getting on out front, he adds, trying to change the subject. I bet Blowers is taking the piss out of Cookie and Hewitt is smoking a shitload of cigarettes, how he says, as McKinney laughs, a little forced, but at least he laughs. Malcolm bursts through the doors behind them, panting from running up the stairs. Lads, there's shitloads of firing coming from the front, you'd better get back, he says, as Howie and McKinney run down the stairs and back along the corridor towards the main entrance. The sounds of the GPMG and the assault rifles get louder as they approach. They burst outside into the bright sunshine and the sight of several hordes walking at a steady pace towards them. Most of them are already halfway across the road and getting closer to the edge of the car park. They've got faster again, Blower shouts as Howie gets to his side. I can see. Shit, Dave still has the radio, Howie says as he and McKinney start firing into the encroaching hordes. The ground is littered with bodies torn apart by the constant fire rate, but the supply of zombies seems endless. Darren moves around to start on the hordes pouring in from the side streets and alleys to the left, tracer fire flashing through the air and shiny spent casings jingling onto the ground. Within minutes, they reach the edge of the car park and are soon starting to cross. Darren adjusts again and concentrates on the ones getting closest, bursting them apart with the large rounds ripping into them. Magazine! Darren yells as the machine gun clicks empty. Fuck it! Focus on the ones getting close! Howie yells as they start shooting into the car park. Dave and Jamie come running around from the side of the hospital and see the immense crowd surging across the roads and car park towards the hospital. Jamie runs to join the others, switching from his sniper rifle to the assault weapon on his back. Dave runs to the rear of the Saxon and climbs in, going straight to one of the compartments and pulling out a canvas bag. He then jumps down and runs around to stand behind the others. Reaching into the bag, he pulls out a hand grenade, pulls the pin and throws the grenade high into the air. It spins and lands in a cluster of cars. Get down! Dave's voice booms out as they all drop down onto the ground. An immense explosion rips the air apart, followed by several more as the fuel tanks of the vehicles explode from the shrapnel and the heat and fire of the grenade. Chunks of metal fly off into the air, taking out more of the undead in the car park, and a huge fireball scorches up into the sky as the fuel burns up. Dave gets back to his feet and throws another one at parked vehicles, and the others all drop down again, covering their heads with their arms as the explosion booms out. Then the fuel tanks go again, creating another enormous fireball. The GPMG starts up again after Darren changes the magazine and then the zombie slaughter continues. Alpha to Charlie, we have heavy contact. Repeat, we have heavy contact. Holding for now. How long will you be? Charlie to Alpha, a few minutes is all we need. Keep holding them. Dave puts the radio back into his pocket and selects another hand grenade, this time throwing it directly onto the massed hordes coming across the main road. The effect is amazing, as a large circle of zombies are suddenly thrown away from the blast, spinning and crashing into more of the undead around them. Dave keeps throwing the grenades, carefully selecting his spots to create the most damage. 
The combined efforts of the GPMG, the assault rifles and the grenades being thrown keep most of the zombies at bay, dropping huge numbers. The sides of the buildings, side streets and access points are thick with undead bodies walking towards them, and slowly they gain ground, inch by inch. The body count climbs swiftly higher and the zombies are forced to clamber and climb over their fallen comrades. Darren continues to fire, choosing the densest parts of the crowd to achieve the maximum amount of damage. At first, it was thrilling to be able to cut so many of them down. And then it became a job, a necessity that had to be done for survival. But now, there is another feeling. A feeling that sends signals to his brain, suggesting that maybe he is doing the wrong thing. These were people. They look like people, and he's killing them without mercy. These were people who had children, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, normal people with lives, and he is just slaughtering them. Darren starts to see the effect of the deadly fire and becomes aware of the bodies being ripped apart and torn limb from limb. Tears start forming in his eyes and slowly drip down his cheeks. He tightens his grip on the trigger as he battles within himself. He knows that this has to be done in order to survive, but slowly that feeling gets stronger, like a voice in his head, gently telling him to stop. The voice of his father, telling him this is wrong. Darren releases his grip on the trigger and freezes, unable to resist the voice any longer, and stops watching the advancing horde. Smithy! Why have you stopped? Howie shouts over, but gets no response as Darren just stares ahead with a frozen expression. Smithy, you have to keep firing, they're getting closer! Howie yells, his voice taking on an angry tone. Blowers! Get on that gun! Howie orders, as Blowers runs to the rear of the Saxon and climbs into the back. Smithy! Mate, get down! Blowers calls up. He gets no response, and calls out again, tugging at Darren's legs and yelling louder and louder. Smithy, for fuck's sake, you'll get us all killed! Get down now or I'll fucking move you myself! Blowers yells up. He's forced to strike the back of Darren's knees, and his legs buckle as he drops down from the lookout hole. Blowers grabs at his shoulders and pulls him away, dumping him on the floor of the Saxon. He climbs up through the hole and takes position on the GPMG, instantly opening fire on the hordes now back in the car park and gaining ground. Howie's face creases with concern for Darren, but his main priority are the thousands of zombies pouring across the road towards them. The pause between Darren stopping and Blowers taking over has allowed them to get so much closer, and they are spread out across the whole of the area now. The weapons cannot cut them down quickly enough. Alpha to Charlie, we are being forced back, we have to move, repeat, we have to move, Dave shouts into the radio over the constant firing all around him. Charlie to Alpha, roger that, we have enough, move out, I repeat, move out. Back to the vehicle, Dave shouts, and they all move backwards, still firing as the closest zombies reach the edge of the car park only a few metres away. They turn and run to the rear, covering each other as they clamber in and then over Darren, who is lying on the ground. Cookie and McKinney pick him up to push him into a sitting position as Darren stares blankly ahead. Howie climbs into the driver's seat and fires the massive engines up, pulling away just as he hears the rear doors slam. Howie drives the Saxon straight into the closest zombies and lets the solid metal plating and huge tyres create a gap as they are mown down and forced apart. The GPMG is still firing away above him, and it cuts them down in droves. Howie forces the vehicle onto the road, and then straight through them, engaging the four-wheel drive capability to keep the power high. The vehicle forces its way through the still upright zombies, and over the already down zombies. The Saxon bounces as it climbs and drops, but does not slow down, taking the obstacles with ease. We'll tuck in behind the truck, Howie yells out to Dave. Alpha to Charlie, we are behind Bravo, we will hold this position. Roger that, Charlie, moving out now. The truck pulls out, following the two four-wheel drive vehicles and heads away from the hospital. Within a short distance, the hordes are left behind and Blowers releases the trigger on the GPMG. Is Smithy okay? Howie calls out. Smithy, Darren mate, are you okay? 
Tucker leans forward, waving his hand in front of Darren's face. Darren slowly comes to and focuses on Tucker. What? What happened? Darren stammers quietly. You froze up, mate. Stop firing and just froze, Tucker says gently. Jesus, I don't know what happened. I don't remember, Darren says, shaking his head. Shock, mate. It's just shock after everything that's happened. Take it easy. Here, have some water. Darren takes the bottle and drinks slowly at first, then gulps it down and belches loudly. He smiles back at Tucker. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened, Darren says, looking at the concerned faces of the lad staring back at him. Don't worry, mate. You were feeling rough earlier, Tucker continues in the same gentle tones. I'll be okay. I am sorry. It won't happen again. Don't worry, mate. Just relax for a bit, Howie calls back as he follows the truck into the maze of side streets. Chapter 54 Sarah's head pokes out from the line of the door, peering out down the corridor looking left and right. No sign of any zombies. No noise either, so she gently creeps out to move down the corridor to the stairwell door. She leans forward to look through the glass pane and pushes the door open to listen for any sounds. Satisfied, she enters and steps quickly down the stairs, checking each window of the doors as she goes. She gets down to the level that Charlie lives on, inches her way to the door and looks through the window. Her breath catches in her throat as she sees the corridor is packed with zombies all clustering around Charlie's front door. Silly bloody fools, she thinks to herself. Their shouting has drawn every undead from the building. But then, if every zombie is in here, then the rest of the building might be clear. She keeps to the stairs, moving quickly and checking each window. She didn't intend to come this far and didn't bring a weapon. But the urge to check the ground floor is strong and she wants to see if they are through the main door yet. At the ground floor, the door doesn't have a window, so she crouches down to push the door open and peer out from a few inches above the floor. The lobby is clear, but she can see to the main doors at the front. The glass is opaque, but she can spot the hundreds of silhouettes on the other side, just a dense, gently moving mass, blocking the light, casting the lobby into shadows. She closes the door and gets back to her feet, biting her bottom lip as she wonders what to do. There must be a rear entrance. The fire safety officials would have insisted on it, surely. Quietly cursing herself for not knowing the layout of her own building, she crouches down again and slowly crawls out of the door and into the lobby. Moving slowly and watching the front door, she moves towards the ground floor apartments. She reaches the corridor leading to the flats and looks to the fire escape door at the end. This door has clear glass and leads out onto a small grassed area that looks clear. Sarah moves quickly down the corridor and reaches the door. There is a safety bar on it. Simply push and walk out. She tries to peer to the left and right. Both sides look clear. To the front is the small lawn separating this block from the next one. She pushes the bar down. The door opens silently and she breathes in almost fresh air. It's tainted by the acrid aroma of the undead that walk around, a few metres away. This is it. The way out. But if she steps out now, the door will close behind her and she'll be stuck, weaponless. Sarah eases back inside and heads over to the stairwell. Climbing quickly back to her own floor, she heads inside her flat and starts preparing to escape. If they're massed to the front she might be able to find a way out of the city, going in the other direction. It's a crazy plan, and she knows it. But she also knows if she waits, she will go mad within days or just become trapped. At least this way, she's doing something of her own choice. Chapter 55 Did you get everything you need? Howie asks Big Chris and the others. They have stopped in a quiet street to discuss the next phase of the plan. Armed men and the recruits stand out on point duty at either end of the small fleet of vehicles. Not quite. Doc Roberts gave us a massive list. We got most of it, though, and loads of medicines from the pharmacy department, Chris replies. At least that's something, then. We can always try more hospitals away from the city later if you need to, Howie says, 
and Chris recognises the genuine offer. We've worked well together so far, Howie. Your lot did a good job of keeping them suppressed, Malcolm says. It was bloody close for a moment or two. One of our blokes seized up. He just froze, poor lad, Howie says, dropping his voice down. It's normal, Howie. They're just kids. The basic training would have assessed them to see what they were like under stress. But they never got that far, did they? It happens sometimes, and those things are still people, sort of. And that will play havoc with a young mind that's already suffered from all this, Chris explains calmly, the voice of experience. How he can see how he came to be such a natural leader. Just take it easy with him and keep an eye on him. Maybe get one of the other lads to pair up or something, Malcolm offers. Yeah, I'll get one of them to stick close to him in case it happens again. I do feel for them, but there's no hiding from this. It's happening, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. Right, so where does your sister live? Big Chris switches back to business. Dave, have you got that address book? Howie asks, and Dave pulls it from his bag and hands the brightly covered small hardback book over to him. Howie flicks through the pages, his heart twinging with pain from seeing his mother's handwriting again and the names of relatives now gone. Millennium Towers, just off West Ferry Road, Howie reads out, and looks up to see Chris and Malcolm examining a road atlas. I got West Ferry Road. It's this big, straight one here, Malcolm traces the road with his finger. Any idea which street it is? he asks. Smithson Street. Mum wrote it down the side, Howie says, his head down. Yeah, got it. Right, we can go straight down West Ferry. It looks long and straight, or we can work in from the back roads, Malcolm says. We can get to West Ferry Circus Roundabout and Recce from there. If West Ferry Road is no good, we can go round, but there's this bloody big bit of water in the middle and only one other road leading over it at the other end, Chris says. Try for the roundabout and then see what it's like, I guess, Howie says. OK, slight change to the formation. Saxon up front as lead vehicle, Alpha. I will take second position as Bravo, and the truck third as Charlie with you, Malcolm, bringing up the rear as Delta again. This gives us two lead support vehicles and offers greater protection for the truck, Chris says, looking around at them. If the truck is that valuable, send it back now and don't risk taking it further into their ground. We've still got three vehicles left, Dave says. He's right, Chris truck is big and strong and good for ploughing through them, but we can't risk losing it now. I think we should send it back. All those things were coming this way, so it should have an easy ride home, Malcolm says, looking directly at his old friend. Howie, what do you think? Chris asks, to Howie's surprise. He is just a supermarket manager, not a military strategist, and he feels honoured to be asked his opinion. I have to agree with Dave and Malcolm. The truck's contents could save many lives. Sarah is my sister, but she is only one person. OK, agreed. We send the truck back, which makes the Saxon Alpha, me, Bravo and Malcolm as Charlie. We head on this route to the roundabout and see what happens from there, Chris says, and they part company. Howie and Dave walk back to the Saxon, with Howie hoping he can remember the new call signs. He thinks of Sarah and the long days she must have been waiting in her apartment. I hope she's all right, mate, Howie says. Me too, Dave replies. Gonna be a hell of a scrap getting through them. Not the first one, though, is it, Mr Howie? Dave says, giving one of his rare smiles, and Howie laughs. No, mate, I guess not. The vehicles drive back to Tower Bridge and escort the truck to the control room. The main road is still clogged with undead, but they plough through as Tucker uses the GPMG to cut them down as they go. Back on the deserted bridge, Hewitt goes into the control room and lowers it. The two halves drop down until they connect and the road is normal again. Rows of zombies that got stuck from the bridge going up start shuffling across again as Hewitt raises it a few inches to watch them struggle walking uphill. He waits until they almost reach the middle and raises it higher, so they all tumble back. He laughs loudly as he watches the monitors above the control panel. The others all hear him laughing and cram into the small room to watch him do it again. That's fucking funny, Blowers laughs, wiping tears of merriment from his eyes. Big Chris and his men have crammed in and are laughing too. 
Hewitt lowers the bridge and examines the control panel more intently. The zombies all start forwards again, trampling over the increasing numbers of squashed undead as they go. Ha! Watch this! Hewitt shouts out. The zombies walk over the first half of the bridge, and just as they get to the middle, Hewitt raises the closest half, which lifts up a few feet and blocks them from walking forward. The momentum of the zombies is too great and the first few rows get crushed as more keep trying to walk forward. Everyone in the control room laughs as Hewitt lifts it another foot or so and they watch the zombies getting crushed on the monitors. Hewitt then drops the bridge back down to normal level and they all fall forward as the barrier holding them in place is suddenly taken away. The room erupts in laughter as the zombies all fall forward onto their faces and Hewitt quickly raises the bridge again to stop them coming onto this side. Hang on, I've got another one, Hewitt laughs as he waits for the bodies to press against the slightly raised nearest section again. The bodies keep pushing forward until there is a massive horde pushing and trying to walk forward. Hewitt suddenly raises the nearest half of the bridge and the bodies tumble forward and down into the river as the barrier is once again released. Howie bursts out laughing and looks at Dave as they remember doing something similar with a smaller bridge in one of the villages they passed through. The bodies keep pushing forward and stepping out onto thin air as they are pushed from behind by the pressing horde. They just keep going, Hewitt says, bent over double, laughing, as they keep walking and shuffling forward and dropping down into the river with a splash. Big Chris, Malcolm and the big bald man are all laughing hard at the ridiculous sight. Even Dave smiles as he watches the spectacle, until the last of the undead falls off the edge and down into the River Thames. That was bloody brilliant, Chris says with an enormous smile, showing his white teeth. They all laugh and then start applauding Hewitt as he turns and takes a mock bow to them, laughing himself. But Darren is at the back. Watching the undead fall off the bridge, he smiles along with the joke, but inside he feels different. This isn't funny, and they shouldn't be doing this. Suddenly he feels very alone. He smiles and goes along with it, but his eyes are not laughing. The truck moves off along a now clear bridge, and the men file back to their vehicles, laughing and joking. Howie gets into the driver's seat as Tucker shouts down. What were you all laughing about, and why did the bridge keep going up and down? Nick was playing with the zombies on the other side, making them fall into the river, Blowers calls up as he settles into the back of the Saxon. That was bloody funny, McKinney says. Howie had taken McKinney to one side as they walked back to the Saxon. McKinney, can you do me a favour, mate? Howie asks him. Yes, Mr Howie, McKinney replies. I'm worried about Smithy. Can you pair up with him and keep an eye on him, just in case he freezes again? Yeah, no problem. Does he know you've asked me? McKinney asked. No, I don't want to make him think we're watching him or anything like that. Just keep an eye out so he doesn't get hurt or something. Howie says quietly, as McKinney nods and climbs into the back of the Saxon. Right, you ready for this, Dave? Howie asks, as he starts the engine and turns the Saxon in a wide arc to drive back down the bridge. Yes, Mr Howie, Dave replies as they move off, slowly waiting for the two four-wheel drive vehicles to catch them up. They head back onto the main road to follow the route they agreed on. Within minutes, though, the road is full of undead, back to shuffling slowly and again moving in the same direction as they are. They're ignoring us again. What's going on? They were going nuts for us at the hospital and now they're not even looking at us, Howie says. Maybe they know where we're going and want to use their speed only when we're static, Dave answers. As crazy as that sounds, mate, it does make sense. They ignored us all the way here and only came for us when we stopped at the hospital. And they did speed up. That could have got very messy if they had started running. Maybe moving faster makes them weaker, Blowers adds from behind them. I've been thinking that. At the services, they were running and we were putting them down with ease. Did you notice if they were weaker today? No, not really, Blowers answers. But if they only just started moving and it was only a bit faster... It might not be enough to make them weaker that quickly, Dave says. Okay, that makes sense. But how do they know where we are or where we're going, Howie asks, to silence. It can't just be a coincidence. We're specifically going for Canary Wharf and they are certainly heading that way now, Howie adds. 
They haven't attacked Chris's commune in large numbers or with the ferocity they've shown us. We have killed many of them, Mr Howie. That's the only link. We've cut them back and they don't like it, Dave says. Well, do you know what I think about that? Howie asks. I think fuck them. I'll keep killing them every chance I get until the last one fucking drops. He spits out his words with venom in his voice. Darren listens intently, a feeling of alarm inside him from Howie's words. He respects this man deeply and would follow him anywhere. But now there is doubt creeping in. Howie wants to slaughter every one of them and that isn't right. They don't deserve that, do they? The voice in his head, the voice of his father, speaks out, telling him this is not right. Howie has no right to do this. If he left them alone, they might have left him alone. Howie is leading them all to danger with his reckless actions and will cause the death of all these people. The voice carries on, and Darren sits quietly in the back of the Saxon, with his mind deep in conflict. Bravo to Alpha. Alpha receiving, go ahead, bravo. The road looks almost blocked. Can you make it through? Affirmative, we are moving through them without issue. Roger that. We will close the gap and travel right on your tail to keep a solid line. Bravo to Charlie. Close up on our tail and keep a solid line. Charlie to Bravo. Roger that. Closing up now. Nose to tail. Bravo to Alpha. We are nose to tail on you now. Bravo out. Dave climbs out of the passenger seat and gets Tucker down from the GPMG so he can climb up and look out. Once up top... He scans the road ahead and the solid lines of zombies traipsing in the same direction as them. The front of the Saxon pushes them aside or knocks them flat, and the Saxon rocks with the constant bumps from the bodies it runs over. The power of the vehicle is immense, and they force an easy enough path through. Dave drops down and pulls out another canvas bag full of grenades from a compartment, then climbs back up to the lookout position, resting the bag between his body and the edge of the hole. Alpha to units, be aware, be aware. Grenades being thrown behind the convoy, be aware. Dave speaks into the radio and hears both units confirm their acknowledgement. He then looks back to see Big Chris's vehicle within inches of the back of the Saxon and Malcolm's vehicle within inches of Chris's, keeping a solid line to prevent the hordes from slipping between the vehicles and isolating them. Dave pulls out a grenade and pulls the pin. He looks at the sides, the front and then back at the rear and the solid mass of zombies swarming in the wake left by the vehicles. He pulls his arm back and launches the first one high in the air. It lands far beyond the back of the last vehicle. Within a few seconds, a muffled explosion booms out and bodies are seen flying up into the air. Dave can see a wide circle form as the deadly shrapnel rips through the densely packed bodies. He repeats the action launching grenade after grenade behind the vehicles, and before long, he can see a distinct gap forming behind him. Each grenade takes out several undead immediately, but the shrapnel takes more down with horrific injuries, and those bodies are sent hurtling into others. Dave empties the bag of grenades and looks with satisfaction at the huge holes now forming behind them. He then turns and grips the GPMG and focuses it on the ones in front of him. He takes a practice sweep from left to right, aiming directly in front of the Saxon. Then, nodding to himself, he squeezes the trigger and sweeps back right to left, aiming directly at head height and watching as skull after skull explodes like a row of melons. Brains and bones burst up into the air. Dave extends the aim and keeps going, focusing to keep the machine gun at head height and take as many heads off as possible. Fucking hell, look at that! Lois shouts from his position in the front passenger seat next to Howie. They hear the muffled pops of the grenades thrown by Dave, and then the sudden whoomp-whoomp of the machine gun above them. The closest zombies are all mown down by the hail of bullets, and Dave starts on the next load, taking the heads off with each accurate sweep. He's getting bloody headshots with a heavy calibre machine gun, Lois shouts, as the lads all pile up front to watch the work being done by Dave. All of them cheer as the heads pop like fireworks, one after the other. Dave keeps the motion going, sweeping steadily side to side and cutting down swathes of undead. He extends his range and is soon taking them out at the sides too. 
A look of intense concentration is on his face as he aims directly at the heads and sweeps the bullets across to see head after head popping open and the body slumping down. The shooting to the sides means that Chris and his men see the awesome display being put on by Dave and they cheer and shout as they watch the skulls bursting open in precise lines. Only fucking special forces would do something that crazy, Chris mutters to himself, but can't help grinning at the sight of the craniums being popped open. They reach the West Ferry Circus roundabout and wait in situ, as Dave continues with the machine gun, sweeping low at first and taking the closest ring out, then lifting the aim higher and higher with each sweep, until there are almost concentric circles of decapitated bodies lying all around the vehicles. Eventually, he stops and climbs back down into the Saxon, to a roar of cheers from the recruits. He gives a slight smile as he climbs back to the front seat, respectfully vacated by blowers. Bravo to Alpha. Nice display. Charlie to Alpha. Likewise. Small words, but big compliments coming from such hardened and battle-experienced men. The Saxon sits on the exit road to West Ferry Road, facing in the direction they need to go, at a solid, massed gathering of undead, stretched out as far as the eye can see. It is an undulating carpet of bodies, once killed and now brought back to semi-life, with a hunger for human flesh. They hold position, and don't move an inch towards the Saxon. Howie gets out of the Saxon and walks around to the front, staring hard at the blocked road. His eyes move along the front row, sweeping across the horde. Dave joins him, and they look ahead, silently. The recruits come out to stand to the sides of them, one by one. Big Chris and his men, Malcolm and his men, all step out of their vehicles and walk forward to the front of the Saxon and stand with Howie. They stare at the lines ahead of them. An enemy holding position in readiness for battle. Thousands of enemy undead, waiting for these few to try and take them. They know these things can now move fast if they want to that they can change within a split second and become deadlier than the slow, shuffling things they have faced already. How far up is it? Howie asks. Third on the left, Malcolm replies. They can move fast now and they can change. They will change and they will come for us. Do you have a plan? Malcolm asks. Yes, Howie replies. What is it? Chris asks. To go and get my sister, Howie replies. How? Chris says. Go in there and get her out, Harry replies. There's a lot of them, Malcolm adds. There is, Howie replies. Listen, you've all helped me get this far, but this is my issue. None of you have to do this with me. You don't have to risk your lives for this. You'd go on your own? Chris asks quietly. Yes, Howie replies instantly. No, he wouldn't. Dave speaks with a firm voice. Not without me either, Blower says. Me too, Cookie adds. Howie looks back to the lads standing to the sides of him. They look to him and nod firmly. All of us, Blower speaks for the group. Okay, how? Chris asks. Howie looks back at the Saxon, then to the horde waiting for them. We'll charge them, Howie says. The other vehicles won't get more than a few metres into that lot, Chris says. Then we all go in the Saxon, the big man with the bald head says. Good plan. I'm in, Chris adds. Me too, Malcolm says. Fuck it, let's load up then, Chris says, as they all turn and walk back into the Saxon in silence. Howie sits in the driver's seat, slowly increasing the pressure on his right foot and making the engine roar loudly. Big Chris clambers through and gets up on the GPMG, his large frame barely fitting into the hole. The Saxon surges forward, Howie working through the gears as the engine increases in pitch, racing towards the waiting hordes. Big Chris opens up on the GPMG, sweeping across the front ranks and cutting them down with a deadly hail of lead. The ranks get cut down from the ferocious firing, but they hold position as the bullets rip through them. At the last few hundred metres, Chris aims directly in front of them, making small movements left and right, chopping them down and creating a hole for the Saxon. The Saxon slams into them with enormous power and speed. The impact jolts each man inside, 
but Chris braces his powerful legs and absorbs the blow into his large frame, his hands never leaving the machine gun. He spins around, cutting them down, then sweeps back to the front and works to carve a hole for the Saxon. The vehicle ploughs into the bodies and Howie selects the four-wheel drive to keep the vehicle surging forward. The huge tyres keep their grip and bounce over bodies, crushing them into a pulp. The vehicle keeps going further and further into the bodies, and the engine screams as Howie applies more power to his foot, forcing the heavy vehicle to slam them down or send them spinning off to the sides. Within seconds, they are deep into the horde and ramming the zombies away as they keep pushing towards the third junction on the left. The first one passes and the Saxon powers on, taking each body down with ease. The GPMG spews a hail of rounds into the bodies in front of the vehicle as they gradually work closer and closer. They pass the second junction and suddenly the massed horde surges forward into the path of the Saxon. The bodies push and press and the gaps between them close up as they become a solid object. The third junction gets closer and closer as the vehicle keeps going, punishing the zombies for daring to be in the way. The undead keep pushing forward, forcing more and more bodies into the path of the vehicle. More bodies push them from behind too, as the zombies stretch away for miles in every direction. The Saxon reaches the junction and starts to slow as the sheer weight of bodies prevents it from advancing. Howie pushes his foot flat to the floor and the Saxon's engines scream out. They gain ground, inch by inch, slowly crushing the bodies in front of them. The GPMG sends a withering hail into the zombies and they drop down, allowing the Saxon to keep pushing forward. But the horde is relentless and keeps pushing back. A solid object against an immovable force. The competition goes on as the machine gun rips them apart and creates small gaps for the Saxon to push into. You'll blow the engine, a voice shouts from the back, and Howie is forced to ease off. The sudden reduction in power brings the Saxon to a halt, jammed in a sea of zombies pushing closer and closer into them. I'll cut down a gap, then we're out and fighting for it. Make ready, Chris yells down and commences firing again, moving slowly around in circles to create an ever-increasing gap around the Saxon. He spins, and the constant rain of bullets shreds the zombies to pieces. The bodies rack up and form a barrier to those behind, and he keeps spinning around as the circle surrounding the Saxon gradually grows more and more. Make ready, Chris bellows, as the men inside the vehicle prepare for their big moment. Chapter 56 Sarah empties her gym rucksack on the bed sending white socks, deodorant and a small makeup bag tumbling across the crumpled bedsheets. She grabs two bottles of water, the only two actual water bottles she has in the apartment, and pushes them into the bag. Next, she goes to the cupboard and looks at the tinned food. Tins are heavy and too many will slow her down, plus the bag isn't that big, and also they will clunk together and make noise as she moves. But she needs food and everything else has been eaten, After minutes spent deciding, she finally chooses three tins and takes them to the bag, then runs back to take the tin opener from the drawer. What else will I need? She mutters quietly, having learnt years ago that talking to herself calms her down and helps her to rationalise her mind. Water, food, got them. What about clothes? She puts in clean panties and a pair of socks, then quickly pulls them out, chastising herself. Within minutes, she puts them back in and stands back to stare at the bag, waiting for inspiration to strike her. That's it then, all I need. Water, food and clean pants, she mutters again, and closes the bag up before shrugging it on her back, feeling uncool for using both straps, then laughing at herself for the ridiculous thought. She gathers up her homemade spear, the broomstick with the long knife attached to the end, and walks towards her apartment door, pausing to listen before she opens it. A noise, some kind of bang. She drops her head down to listen harder. There it is again, a muffled, constant thumping. She moves away from the door and back into her apartment, and the noise gets louder. A fast banging noise that's familiar, but not quite there in her head yet. She moves to the patio door and slides it open. The noise floods in, and she looks down onto the solid crowd of zombies jammed into the pavement. Her eyes follow the line of them, realising they're all facing in the same direction, down to the main road. 
they're all facing and pushing towards West Ferry Road. She leans out to try and see down to the junction and gasps as she takes in the amount of undead crammed into the area. Every single one of them is pushing towards the main road. She waits, leaning over the balcony, the broom spear stick still in her hand. Slowly, the noise gets louder until an army-type vehicle comes into view. Even from this distance, she can see the outline of the giant vehicle and someone standing halfway out of the roof. Bright flashes flare out from the top of the vehicle and she realises that the man is firing a machine gun into the zombies. Her heart races as she watches the desperate struggle, the vehicle inching forward bit by bit as it gets closer to her junction. It looks like it's trying to turn into her road and then comes to a halt as the pressure of the bodies force it to a stop. The man on top spins around and Sarah watches a space slowly being created around the vehicle as the machine gun cuts them down. Hope is surging through her, but it starts to ebb away as she realises that the vehicle is stuck and can no longer move forward. Sarah watches as the firing stops and the man drops out of view. Then another man climbs out and stands on top of the vehicle. He's followed by the first man again. It looks like the man standing up is holding a large bag. He rests it down and she watches as he takes something out of it, then throws it high in the air. Sarah hears a loud bang and sees bodies flying upwards. The man throws something again and after a few seconds she hears another loud bang and more bodies are shot up and away. Grenades. He's throwing grenades, she whispers quietly. The man is throwing them down into her road and making a point of making them land at different points. Each throw is followed by a loud explosion and she watches as gaps start forming where the bodies are blown away and more are felled by the blasts. The machine gun keeps firing and more and more of them are cut down. The machine gun appears to be focusing on keeping them away from the vehicle while the grenade man is launching the explosives down her road. Slowly the gaps get bigger as more damage is reaped on the undead. She wants to scream and wave to tell them she is here but she can see the hopeless situation they're in, and she watches in silence, willing them to break free somehow. Chapter 57 The anger bursts inside me, filling me with rage and cold, hard fury. We are stuck in an ocean of never-ending undead zombies. I fucking hate them. I fucking hate zombies. I hate the way they shuffle and groan. I hate the way they move fast without warning and change the rules as they go along. I hate their decomposing flesh and their rancid, putrid breath. I hate the drool that drips from their mouths and their red, bloodshot, dead eyes. Everything around me slows. The firing above my head becomes a slow thump, thump and I see shiny spent casings spinning down gently past the window. I see a grenade rolling end over end through the air until it drops down out of sight, and an eternity passes before the slow explosion erupts ahead of me. Bodies are floating through the air, limbs detached and flying off, and drops of blood are strung out and arcing high. My eyes follow another grenade that spins in the air above me, going down into the road. As I follow the trajectory, I see the tall apartment blocks further up the street and the outline of a person standing on one of the balconies facing towards us. My eyes fix on that spot and I feel the person is staring straight at me. Suddenly, it's not just anger inside me. There is hope, too. I snap back to reality as I realise there is a gap in front of us created by the GPMG spinning around and I engage the gears and push the Saxon and bounce high over the many fallen bodies. Just in those few metres, we gain enough speed to slam into the crowd and send them backwards. The grenades thrown by Dave have created gaps that we can use to our advantage by pushing the zombies back. We gain a little more distance and I see Chris is firing directly in front of us again. He has created small gaps for the Saxon to power into. Little by little, metre by metre, we gain ground, and I keep looking up to see the person still watching us from the balcony. I select reverse gear and slam the Saxon back into the crowd behind us, crushing yet more of them and gaining a little space in front, to gather some speed before I use the front as a battering ram to drive further into them. 
The machine gun and the grenades do an amazing job of making little pockets of space, which I use to force them back. The vehicle is tons of solid steel, with more weight added by the numbers of people inside, and although the crowd is incredibly dense, they cannot withstand the force of the vehicle repeatedly hammering them. The progress is painfully slow, but at least we have progress. Pull back and hold for a second, Big Chris yells, and I change into reverse to force the Saxon backwards, impacting on the crowd that is surging forward to fill the gaps. Hold, Chris yells, and the GPMG remains firing directly ahead of us, making little sweeps left and right at the same width as the vehicle. The bodies are decimated right in front of me, torn limb from limb and cut in half as the rounds slice through them with ease. Chris holds the firing position as a large hole is made with fallen bodies lying like felled trees on the ground. The GPMG clicks empty as Chris roars, Now! I push my foot down hard and the vehicle pulls ahead with amazing speed, crushing the bodies under the huge tyres. We bounce up high from the impact on so many corpses, but the vehicle slams back down and keeps pushing forward. That extra speed we used has gained the momentum to drive us further ahead than I had hoped for, and I look up to see the person waving from the balcony as we get closer and closer. Then we are close enough to see the front of the building and a large plaque reading Millennium Tower, and that hope inside me gets stronger with every inch of ground we gain. The horde suddenly surges forward, moving with speed as they slam into the front of the Saxon, the bodies pushing hard against each other to make a solid wall. Something is wrong with the GPMG, as it doesn't resume firing from running empty. I try to pull back, but the Saxon moves inches before losing power, such is the force of the bodies pushing against us. We're bogged in, I yell out. We'll have to fight through on foot. I clamber out over the seat and try to get in the back, but there are too many people. No room to manoeuvre. Get a few on the roof to shoot down, then more at the back. Doors ready! Dave yells out as some of the recruits and Chris's men clamber up through the GPMG hole and start firing down into the surrounding hordes. I glance back through the windscreen and can see the zombies are stretching their arms up now and trying to reach up to the men on the top, their teeth bared, almost angry expressions on their rotting faces. When I shout, push those doors open and fire out, Dave yells down. Get to the back! Two lines with front line crouching and rear line standing, I yell out, as they try to organise themselves in the confined space, pushing and shoving until they are formed up and ready. One of Chris's men at the front shouts for the rear line to move backwards, so the hot casings don't land on them. Make ready, Dave yells down above the constant firing of assault weapons. We're making a bit of room at the back. You'll have time for one round of firing to cut more down and then we have to charge them, he adds. I see the big, bald man work his way back to me with his axe in his hands. When they stop firing, we'll burst out with the axes and try to clear them back, he says to me. I'll go with you, Blowers adds, grabbing his axe. The rest of the axes are stacked up and ready to be taken by the others. Us three first and then this lot behind us. We're heading for Millennium Towers. It's just up a bit and on the left, I shout out so they can all hear me, and I hear Dave repeat my words to the lads on the top. The firing continues, and I see knuckles going white as the men in front of me grip their weapons tightly, faces serious. They stare forward with fear and terror, but above all else, they have courage. The courage to face down an enemy that outnumbers them thousands to one. The courage to stand firm and not fold or back away. Hardened men, tough men, relying on each other and their natural-born instinct to fight and survive. They have a reason to fight, a purpose, something to believe in, and we stand together, ready to charge to our deaths if need be, ready to lay our lives down for the right to live how we want. We repel the idea of these foul things that have tainted this earth and caused the deaths of so many innocent people. I don't know your name, I say to the big man with the bald head. Clarence, he replies, looking me dead in the eye. Good to meet you, Clarence. You too. Dave lightly drops down onto his feet and draws his knives. He holds them with the blades upright and reversed to press into his forearms.
The action sends a fresh surge of adrenaline through me, and I see Blowers grip the handle of his axe, a dark look crossing his face. That action by Dave has preceded every fight so far, and it signifies our readiness for battle. Our willingness to do battle. Our right to do battle, and do so on our terms, for we have taken the fight to them today. They are thousands and we are few, but we came for them. They stood and waited, and we charged them. This battle was ours for the choosing, and we took that choice. My breathing gets faster and my chest rises. My hands were shaking a little, but now they are steady, and my legs feel firm and strong. My grip won't fail me, and I know what needs to be done. A sensation within me, a tingling inside my stomach. Hairs on the back of my neck prickle as I hear it once more knocking on the door to my soul. What do you want? I know what it wants. I want to come in. Why? Because you need me. I rely on you too much. You can't do this without me, Howie. Maybe this time I can. Without me, you will die, and Sarah will die, because of you. I can't keep using you like this. Why not? The more I use you, the more I want. You can't get through this without me, and you know that. You have no choice. But my costs are mounting, and payment is due. It's too much, but I want you. I need you. Then let me in, Howie. I want to. I like it when you come in. So? That's the problem. You're addictive and it's dangerous. But you wouldn't have got this far without me. I know that. So let me in. Do you want to come in? Yes. What if one day I can't shut you out again? Worry about that later. You need me now more than ever. Okay, but this has to stop soon. I understand, but not now. Come in. You're not alone. Who are they? You've met them before. Rage, fury and wrath. Bring them. Bring them all. You're right, I am addictive, aren't I? Yes, but you need me, don't you? Yes, you need all of us. Yes. Open the door wide, Howie. Open it wide and leave it open this time. I think we'll be coming back quite often. Now! Dave roars the words so loudly that every zombie for miles must be able to hear him. The back doors are thrown open wide and the firing commences as eight men open fire with fully automatic assault rifles. Four crouched and four standing, shoulder to shoulder, jammed in tight and deafening each other. The immediate ground at the back of the Saxon is already clear from the men firing from the roof. The split-second timing works perfectly as the men in the rear and the men on the top all fire into the packed horde. The effect is devastating as the first few ranks are cut to pieces and the force of the rounds drives them backwards into the zombies behind them. I hear the guns click empty and the men burst two to each side as they create a gap wide enough for one man to go through. I am that man, and I run through them and launch myself high out of the back doors with my beautiful double-bladed axe wide out to my side. I land with my feet planted apart and sweep in a wide arc as I slice through several necks extended in front of me. I take a step forward and swing backwards, cleaving more of them open with the deadly blades. My voice roars as I take those first swipes, and I feel the glory of the first death from my hands sweep through me. I scream out and plunge forward, swinging the axe around with fearsome power and speed. I hear voices behind me, and the recruits and men are pouring out the charge into the lines of zombies. You are thousands, and we are few, but we fucking charge at you with axes and knives. We fucking take you on with the weapons we hold, and we will defeat you. I hear the glorious sound of Dave roaring at full volume, and I lift my voice to join his. I see him off to my side as he launches himself fully into them, his arms spinning with grace and supple power as he bends and flexes to slice their throats, then drops down to cut through Achilles' tendons and they fall from their weakened legs. Clarence stands back and swings his double-bladed axe high above his head. A Viking warrior. 
a berserker of gigantic size, and he steps forward with long strides. His almighty power sweeps the axe through many bodies as he swings out, then back again as he takes another big step. We roar and we fight, and more of our voices join in, and we take the fight to them. My two-headed axe doubles my ability to kill them and take them down. Bodies fall about me as we fight our way through. We arrange ourselves with the axes to the front, and Dave takes them down to fight a path through. The others behind us keep our backs and sides clear as they hack and cleave the bodies down. They push forward, but we fight harder than they can surge. They try to surround us, but we keep fighting and we make progress through these evil things as they fall under our righteous blades. The battle is brutal, but we fight and power on and each step we take brings us closer to that building. I glance up and see a figure waving down and screaming at us. I raise my axe high and bellow a cry, a cry of war, a cry of violence, and for a second my comrades join me and we raise our weapons up and scream into the air. We are coming. We are fighting for you. We will kill every one of them to get to you. We are coming and we are bringing death with us as we slaughter, hack, slice, chop, cleave, slice, cut and kill the zombie undead. Two sides fighting, but our small size means they can only present a limited front. And we can fight that front, and we do. We cut them down in droves and keep pushing as our hands and arms become slick from the blood we spill. Chapter 58 Sarah watches the men climb on top of the army vehicle and they start firing down at the zombies, keeping the fire pouring onto the undead at the rear. She watches with bated breath as the rear doors burst open and a withering fire from within is directed towards the undead. They burst apart and are sent flying back from the almighty hail sent their way. The second the firing ends, a man launches himself from the back of the vehicle swinging an axe above his head. Sarah's mouth drops open as she realises they are taking on thousands of zombies in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Men surge from the back of the vehicle as they bravely charge into the lines. Even from her high position, she can hear the men roar as they offer challenge to the undead army. The men from the top jump down and they too charge into the melee. The effect is mesmerising. These men, these few men, kill many of the zombies as they fight to gain a circular shape. Men with axes take them down and others work to the sides and the rear as that tiny clear circle of men starts to move through the undead throng. These men are killing machines and they move with deadly purpose, each of them advancing with speed and power and the killing goes on as they leave a bloody wake of broken bodies behind them. Sarah watches the man in the front centre swing his axe, a giant of a man next to him, cleaving the bodies down. She screams to tell them she is watching. Their brave actions have not gone without witness. The man in the front centre looks up and raises his axe high in the air to her. He roars, and every one of those brave warriors stop and hold their weapons high and roar their defiance as they look up at her. Then, as one, the weapons drop back down and they fight with renewed purpose to slaughter the undead. They have seen her. They're coming for her. Howie. It must be Howie. Her heart races as she runs to the front door, not bothering to stop, look or listen, and she charges down the corridor and into the stairwell. As she gallops down the stairs, an undead staggers out from a door in front of her, and Sarah rams the point of her spear deep into its throat. Fuck you! she screams as she pulls the spear out, then continues running down the flights of stairs. Chapter 59 We keep moving forward and our fighting shape holds. We suffer our first loss as one of Chris's men slips on the bloody ground and falls down. We all turn to help but it's too late and the zombies drop down on him, burying their faces into his stomach and legs. He screams with impotent rage, and Dave quickly drops down to slice a blade deep across his throat. Sorry, Dave whispers in his ear, and then is back up fighting. The loss hits us. We fill with rage and fury and fight with a consumed anger that burns our hearts. 
We have lost one of our own to you, and for that you will pay with hundreds now. We won't stop until you all die and cease to be on this earth. Almost there, Dave bellows, his enormous voice drowning the grunts and growls of the men as we fight. We push out harder now, in sight of the doors that lead into Millennium Towers. I look up and see the doors burst open and a woman comes out, screaming with fury. My heart soars as I see my sister, Sarah, marching out, holding the end of a hose like a machine gun. Sarah! I scream and she stops to stare straight at me. Just a few lines between us now and we hack them down. I thought Dave was fighting with awesome speed before, but he goes into overdrive now, his arms spinning with fury as he cuts a path through them and breaks free to race towards Sarah. My world is complete. The toughest, bravest man I have ever known is now by my sister's side. She is safe and will live, as I know that small man will kill anything to protect her. He is my friend. Sarah will live. She will survive. And I smile, staring hard at them as I begin to laugh. I win, you fuckers! I scream out and charge with every ounce of strength I have as the hose opens up. Sarah steps forward slowly as the immense jet of water sluices into the horde and knocks them down. We burst sideways as Sarah walks further towards us. The power of the life-giving water is with us. The clean water is on our side, and that simple thing repels them and forces them back as they lose their grip and slide down. We fight to the sides, and one by one, we burst out of them. Then as one, we turn and form a line in front of Sarah. They keep coming, and we kill them. The power is on our side now as they fight to gain ground, and we fight to protect what we have taken. Dave stands by her side, his knives held ready as he stares with deathly calm at the horde. The powerful jet pushes them back as we start to retreat, and I see Clarence take the hose from her and walk closer to the horde, using the extreme power of the water to send them staggering backwards. Howie! Sarah yells, and I rush to her and wrap my arms around the only surviving member of my family. Sarah, thank God you're okay, I shout back over the noise. We need to get out of here. I glance back at the horde and then to the building. We can't lose that vehicle. We'll never get out of here alive without it, I shout to Dave. Then we fight back to it, Mr Howie, Dave says, loud enough for them all to hear. The men and recruits all stop to stare back at me, looking at Sarah and nodding to her. We have to fight back, I shout out loudly. That vehicle is ours and we must take it back. Big Chris stares at me, then looks at the horde. I hate to say this, but you're right. We have to fight back. Get your sister in the middle and we'll fight the way we came in, he shouts with a ferocious look on his face. Sarah, get in the middle. Dave, stay by her side. He looks at me and nods once, taking a step to stand just in front of her. Form up, Dave bellows, and the men drop back to form a ring around Sarah. She looks to me in horror. We can't go into that lot, she says, terrified. We have to, Sarah. There's thousands of them all round us. The only hope is to get back to our vehicle. Just stay with Dave. Who? she asks, confused. Sarah, this is Dave. Dave, this is Sarah. Now let's go. I take the front centre position again, and we start to step forward as Clarence drops the hose to fall back into step by my side again. Within seconds, we are back in amongst them, fighting and slicing our axes into their soft, decaying bodies. We have our prize. We have the chalice we came for. We are warriors, and all that we need is something to believe in, to protect those that need protection, to have that principle and to fight for it with every breath we take. Not one of us flinches or questions this, for in our hearts we know the reason we are here, to stop the evil from taking her. We fight you to give her life and we will carry on to be sure that happens. Our shape holds as we battle on. They can push as hard as they like, for all they do is force the ones at the front onto our deadly blades and axe heads. Clarence swings the axe with his almighty strength and heads are sent spinning in the air as he chops through necks. Dave sticks by Sarah's side, taking small lunges if one pushes through a gap left by the men at the sides. 
Our tactic works, and once again we make progress, slowly gaining back to the Saxon. Darren fights with courage and bravery, the infection pulling back to watch him during this battle. Chapter 60 As the Saxon powered closer and closer to the building, the infection made a conscious decision to watch from within and learn from his natural reactions. Darren feels his uncertainty leave him, and once again he feels the surge of adrenaline as the last seconds before the battle slowly tick away. He fires from the back of the Saxon and then moves aside to watch with pride as Howie launches out to attack them single-handed. He slots the bayonet on his rifle and bursts out with his mates and the other men to charge into the undead. Feeling hatred and glory, he fights to follow Howie and Dave. They saved him and gave him respect and protection. They made sure he was okay, and they did so many small things that grew a deep sense of respect in him. For that, he fights, and the infection learns the mixture of chemicals pouring into Darren's system that makes him feel like this. Darren hacks away at the zombies and grimaces with determination as they fall under his blows and swipes. He aims for the throat and thrusts deep into their necks. The infection floods every zombie in that area with an image of Darren and makes it clear that they should not touch him. As they gain ground, Darren feels invincible as he cuts down zombie after zombie, not realising they lunge at him but hold back from biting. Several chances present themselves as his increasing reckless bravery leaves him open, but they suppress the urge to bite as Darren becomes the safest man on earth at that moment. They start fighting back towards the Saxon, and the infection plans for the next phase. It floods Darren with adrenaline and a feeling of confidence. Darren laughs as he attacks them, feeling that he cannot be touched. The infection increases the flow, as Darren surges into them for the attack. The infection has learnt what chemicals to release to flood a body with that same feeling of love, pride and devotion towards another body, and it keeps Darren safe as they fight their way back to the vehicle. Within a few metres of them reaching the vehicle, the infection pulls them all back and makes every undead step away and leave their path clear. Chapter 61 We fight on getting closer and closer to the Saxon, when they suddenly pull back and step away from us. Mid-swing they move as one, and there is open space in front of me, as the axe rotates and almost takes me over with it. What's going on? Blower shouts in alarm. They're pulling back! Tucker shouts, with victory in his voice. No, it must be something else. We haven't won this! Big Chris shouts. Stay together and keep in formation, Dave shouts as we move through the clear path towards the Saxon. A noise. I look over to see Darren laughing with unrestrained glee. We've fucking beaten them! The fucking pussies are giving up, he shouts. Dave glances at me and I shake my head. I look over to McKinney and put my fingers to my eyes, then point at Darren. Watch him, I mouth, and McKinney nods and steps closer to Darren. Ah, you fucking losers! We win! We fucking win! Darren screams out. Darren, calm down, mate, I call out as we keep stepping towards the Saxon, only a few metres away now. Why? We've won! We've fucking won! We're untouchable! We can't be beaten! Darren shouts louder and laughs. We get to the Saxon, the rear doors still open. Dave climbs in first as I help Sarah up. Dave goes straight to the GPMG to try and get it working again. The lads and men start piling in as Darren stands away from us all. Come on then, come and fight me! Darren goads them and holds his rifle above his head. Smithy, get back here now! I shout, but he's too far gone. Fucking come on then, come and take me you cunts! Darren screams and suddenly drops the rifle and charges into them. Smithy, stop! McKinney shouts and runs after him. No, stop! I shout, but Darren runs and starts attacking them, taking swipes with his bayonet and thrusting forward to stab them. McKinney catches up with him and tries to pull him back. McKinney tries harder and Darren swings out hard, knocking McKinney to the ground. 
Darren, stop! I shout and start forwards as the horde suddenly approach and start grouping round Darren. You fuckers! I shout and charge forward. The zombies drop down onto McKinney who is trying to crab away. Within seconds, he is swamped with zombies that bite into his legs and stomach. I reach them and swing the axe out to cut them away. McKinney screams from the pain of the bites. I kill those on him and they suddenly draw back again. I drop down to McKinney's side and watch as the blood pours from his mouth. I look down at his savaged body and see his innards spilling out of the ragged wound to his stomach. Mr. Howie, I'm sorry, Mr. Howie, McKinney whispers as more blood cascades out of his mouth. It's okay, mate. I'm sorry, you fought so bravely, you are so very brave. I feel tears spilling down my face as I cradle his head in my hands. Mr. Howie, kill me. Don't let me become one of them, he speaks slowly. I I can't. You'll be okay, we can get you help, I weep as I speak, trying to offer him some comfort. Kill me. Don't let them take me. His voice grows weaker as Dave drops down to my side and stares at me. Don't you fucking touch him, I snarl at Dave. Don't you lay a hand on his fucking head, I scream out as strong hands grip me from behind and pull me away. Don't fucking touch him, I scream at Dave who stares back at me. I see a tear spilling down from his eye, but I keep yelling. Easy, Mr. Howie, take it easy. Clarence's deep voice fills my ear as he pulls me back. Dave, don't fucking do it, don't you fucking dare, I scream, and I see more tears fall down Dave's face. He drops his head and cradles McKinney in his arms. He holds him close as I scream and fight to break free. Dave gently sweeps his blade across McKinney's throat and I see the red blood pouring out from the open artery. Dave, no! I scream and my legs go out from under me. Clarence grips me hard and pulls me back and I hear Sarah's voice but can't make out any words. Dave gently places his hands on McKinney's face and I watch as he closes McKinney's eyes. Then he slowly stands and looks at me, his cheeks wet from the falling tears. Seeing McKinney die and then Dave crying breaks my heart, and I feel myself being pulled into the back of the Saxon. Dave climbs in beside me. Where's Darren? Tucker asks in a quiet voice. They took him, Clarence says. I hear sobs breaking out around me and I watch as Dave's face remains expressionless, but he is still crying. I'm sorry, Mr. Howie, Dave says quietly, staring down at the floor. I see the hardest man I have ever met crumbling in front of me. From that simple act to fulfil a dying man's wish, and I fight my emotions back under control. No, Dave. He looks at me with fear in his eyes. I'm sorry, I say gently, and I hear more sobbing break out around me. The rear doors are pulled closed, and the engine starts. The road must be clear, because we pull away, and I feel the motion of the vehicle. Sarah drops down at my side and she holds me as I fight to keep the tears from coursing down my face. Dave and I stare at each other as we drive away. Chapter 62 Darren is pulled into the horde and fights with fury, still thinking he can take them all on. As Howie weeps over the dying McKinney, the infection floods Darren's system with images and voices that tell him he is the leader now. The infection floods through him, taking him over and turning him. Darren feels the pain course through him as his systems shut down, his heart slows, and he dies quietly from the deadly infection whilst being held gently by the many hands of the undead around him. His eyes close as he ceases to be. His life is over and he is gone. Then they open again, quickly, and Darren Smith stares out from red bloodshot eyes as his heart starts again and the blood is pumped around his now undead body. The infection floods him with a feeling of confidence and strength. The infection floods the horde with the same feelings that Darren used to have, devotion and pride. Now it is no longer targeted towards Howie, but to him, Darren Smith. The undead back away from their new leader and hundreds of red bloodshot eyes stare at Darren as he slowly gets to his feet. They back away and create space around him. 
Darren stands and looks out to the dead form of McKinney. Then, as the zombies fall back to stand in a long line behind him, he stares up at the retreating Saxon and watches as it slowly drives away through the gap left by the zombie undead. Darren Smith stands and stares, thousands of undead all around him, gazing at him with devotion and love. Chemicals are sent coursing through thousands of bodies and a different set of hormones and chemicals are sent through Darren. I am Darren. I am death. And I will come for you, Howie. I am death. And I will come for you. With my army. That was The Undead, Day 4 to Day 6, by R. R. Haywood. Read by Dan Morgan. Keep listening for the first part of the next book in the series, The Undead, Day 7, by R. R. Haywood. Read by Dan Morgan. The Undead, Day 7, by R. R. Haywood. Read by Dan Morgan. The Story So Far Having a rare Friday night off work, Howie was at home when the infection breached the borders of England and soon arrived in his hometown of Boroughfair. Luck saw him through the first night when many others were taken down and infected, only to rise again as the undead. Howie survived these encounters, lurching from catastrophe to disaster, but escaping, learning, evolving and quickly developing a whole new set of skills. With Dave at his side, they braved the urban squalor of a ruined Portsmouth, and in so doing, Howie soon began to understand the desire to remain good in a world rapidly descending into chaos where only the strongest survive. With a plan to rescue Howie's sister from London, Howie and Dave travelled to Salisbury Army Training Barracks to find an armoured personnel carrier that would see them safely through the densely populated and infected towns that lead into the capital. Finding a group of young army recruits at the barracks, Howie quickly took charge and led the young men into the largest battle yet, killing swathes of the undead to reach the armoured vehicle he so desperately needed. The journey then led them to Big Chris, an enigmatic former soldier leading a hastily erected commune in London. Joining forces, they agreed to help each other, going first for valuable medical equipment and then to find Sarah. But the cost of rescuing Sarah may be too much. One of their own has been turned, and what comes back may be the end of everything the group have fought for. The Undead continues. Thursday High above the surface of the earth, water vapour forms in the troposphere and white clouds expand and quickly cast shadows over the already darkening land. Those clouds form and move with the wind and soon cover the once vibrant city of London. The already grim-looking streets and buildings appear more despondent as long shadows form over the bloodstains and the rotting corpses that litter the ground. The abnormally high temperatures of the last week have scorched this normally wet land. Swarms of flies and insects drift around the street, moving from corpse to corpse, laying eggs. Those eggs soon hatch in the perfect breeding ground, and the corpses look alive as thousands of fat white maggots writhe and burrow their way through the skin. The first drops of rainfall drop through the warm air to land on the windscreen of the Saxon armoured personnel carrier driving through those grim city streets back to Tower Bridge. By the time the Saxon enters the bridge, sheets of rain are covering the surface with spray. Visibility is instantly reduced, and the Saxon slows to a stop. One by one, the men climb out from the vehicle and stand under the purifying downpour, letting the water cleanse them from the dirt of battle. Crimson pools form at their feet as the blood is sluiced from their skin and clothes. They hold their heads back, open-mouthed, and drink the cascading cool water. They wipe their hands, pull fingers through their hair, and then wring their clothes out to rid themselves of the filth and gore. The three losses they suffered are heavy on their minds and hearts, and their tears blend with the rain as they cry silently. Now they can grieve and mourn those losses. They know more hardship awaits them, and later there will not be time for mourning. Sarah stands close to the doors of the Saxon, sensing the bond between these men and realising this experience is not hers to share. 
She watches Howie closely and can already see the change in her brother. The goofy, playful, sweet-natured man has been replaced by a hardened warrior. She doesn't know how he came to be here, or what happened along the way, or why the men follow him. But she saw the reaction how he had to the dying lad, and felt the emotion in all of them as they watched him die. Sarah held Howie as he wept in the back of the vehicle, and she looked around to see them all with tear-filled eyes. And that small man called Dave, he stayed by her side throughout the battle back to the Saxon, and the way he moved was extraordinary. It's clear to Sarah that there is a deep connection between her brother and Dave. Now, standing at the back of the vehicle, arms crossed and sheltering from the rain, she watches them as they stand in silence, letting the rain pour down on them. What the fuck happened, Dave? Howie asks. I don't know, Mr Howie. We were doing so well, Howie says, shaking his head. I know we lost one on the way in, but I thought we'd all be slaughtered. There were so many of them. Dave nods as Howie speaks. Why did they suddenly stop? I don't know. And what happened to Darren? He just charged them on his own. And I told McKinney to keep an eye on him and stay close. And now he's dead, Howie says, holding his hands to his forehead. It's not your fault, Mr Howie. Some people just react that way. Dave replies, with a rare troubled look on his face. No, that was something else, mate, Howie shakes his head. It was as if he was possessed or something. I know he'd been feeling rough, but he fought well. He was a brave lad, and to end like that was awful. Poor McKinney. Did you know his mother died just a few months ago? He told me when we were in the hospital... He said he hated hospitals because they reminded him of when his mother was sick. I took him to his death for my own gain. I led them both into it and now they're gone. Something wasn't right with Darren, Dave says quietly. Yeah, he was sick and we took him into that fight, Howie snaps back. No, I mean something wasn't right with him, Dave replies, his voice trailing off. What does that mean? I don't know. He was reckless and taking stupid risks, and he hadn't fought like that before. He kept putting himself at risk and getting away with it. We all put ourselves at risk. It was a monumentally stupid thing to do. No, they had chances to take him. I took a couple out, but I saw them holding back. What do you mean? Howie says. Dave shrugs and shakes his head. They could have had him. They had chances. The way he was overextending himself and lunging too far forward. Dave, what are you saying? Howie asks, concerned at the tone of his friend's voice. You said that he was sick. Yeah, well, we knew he was sick, Howie says, confused. He looked sick, and he said he felt sick. Then he started going crazy, and they were holding back on him. Maybe they were holding back on all of us. I mean, they stopped and moved back, didn't they? No, they certainly weren't holding back on me. That's what I mean. They took one of Big Chris's men down, and they took McKinney down in seconds, so why not Darren? They did take him, Howie starts to say. Did they? I didn't see it. I saw him being taken by them, but I didn't see them bite or attack him. They just enveloped him, and he was gone. And when he charged and attacked them, they didn't react. Not one of them went for him. But when McKinney got to him, they had him instantly. Dave, Howie says, shaking his head. Spit it out, mate. I don't know, but it's like they didn't want to take him. Think, Mr Howie. I know you were upset about McKinney, but you saw it. You were the closest to them, Dave says firmly. Howie looks down to the water, thinking back to just a short time ago. Darren had become very strange screaming abuse at the undead and goading them to fight him. He did charge at them, and he can't remember Darren being attacked. He clearly remembers seeing McKinney on the ground with zombies biting into him, and then how he was there with his axe, knocking them back. I didn't see Darren being attacked, but that doesn't mean he wasn't, how he says. They were both there at the front. Darren was attacking them, and McKinney was trying to stop him. We all saw that. So why kill McKinney and not Darren? I ran to them and couldn't see Darren. He was gone. 
Dave says. Is this a private conversation? Big Chris asks as he walks up to them. Chris, did you see what happened to Darren? Howie inquires. Those things had him, Chris answers, confused at the question. What did you see, Chris? Howie questions, staring hard at the big man as Malcolm and Clarence walk over to them. Lads, come over here, Howie calls out to the rest, and they start drifting closer until they're all standing round Howie and Dave in the pouring rain. Sarah moves closer, watching the group and the serious expression on her brother's face. Listen, I'm sorry for what happened back there. Both of our groups lost people, and watching McKinney die like that was truly awful. Howie watches as the recruit's eyes drop down, fresh tears falling. I know it's painful, but did anyone see what happened to Smithy? Howie instantly regrets using the nickname they had all used for Darren. He went fucking nuts and got McKinney killed, Cookie spits out with a flash of anger, and Howie watches a few of them nod in agreement. We need to think about this clearly. He was sick, right? Then he felt better. Then he was laughing and shouting as we fought. I haven't seen him do that before, but you know him better. No, he never did anything like that before, Blowers answers. Right at the end, when he charged them on his own, what did you see? How he presses them. Sir, he ran forward screaming, then he started attacking them. They didn't react, though. They just stood there and took it. And then McKinney tried to pull him back and he got pushed off. Then he tried again and Darren knocked him down, Jamie says. Then they went for McKinney and Darren got pulled in. The rest of the group all stare at him and he blushes from the sudden attention. Jamie, you saw all of this, Howie asks. Yes, Mr Howie. They didn't bite him or anything. They just grabbed him. He was gone. Did anyone see Darren getting bitten? Howie asks the group. What's this about, Howie? Chris asks with a serious expression. Dave says that Darren was fighting recklessly, putting himself at risk, but those things didn't go for him. They were holding back. You think he's one of them? Malcolm finally voices the unspoken thoughts. I don't know, but he was sick, then he went nuts, and they didn't go for him. Howie shrugs. Fuck me, Blur says, reeling from the idea. No way, Tucker adds. He stopped firing on that fucking GPMG at the hospital too, Blowers suddenly adds. He did what? Chris asks, turning on Blowers. While you lot were inside, we had a massive contact at the front. Darren was on the GPMG and he just froze up. I had to drag him down to take over. But anyone infected just goes down. I've seen it too many times, Clarence rumbles. It's a possibility, but I don't know how. He hadn't been bitten or scratched that I saw, Howie says. So, worst case scenario, he's one of them, Chris asks. We have to consider it, Dave says firmly. They stand in silence, absorbing the idea and its implications. So, if he is one of them, does that mean anything to us? Cookie asks. Yes, replies Dave. He knows our numbers, strengths, where we're heading, the route we took, the access and egress points, Chris says. So why aren't they attacking? Blowers asks. I don't know. They stopped back there and just let us go, Howie says. Maybe they stopped so Darren would go for them, Dave adds. That would be suggesting it has some form of intelligence, said Malcolm. They knew where we were going. They massed in the exact place we were heading for. And if Darren was one of them, that explains how they knew where we were going, Howie theorised, which shows a form of intelligence. If they have intelligence, then they pulled back as a tactic. They use strategy to take what they wanted, Chris says. What for? Why would they want Darren? Tucker asks, trying to keep up. If he was the only one infected, then it would have to be him, Howie says. This is fucking ridiculous, Nick Hewitt suddenly adds. They're just fucking mindless zombies, that's all. They can't plan or make tactics. They were walking off the fucking bridge, for God's sake. 
It makes sense. Perfect sense, Sarah cuts in as they all turn to stare at her. Those things were outside before you came, but nowhere near the numbers they are now. They must have known where you were going and flooded the area, ready for you. And if they knew that lad was infected, then why not take him? He's one of theirs, she continues. They came for us at the services. They sent loads after us. And those people said they had gone unnoticed before we arrived. And we already said it was like we were being targeted, affirms Howie. Then they know about our place, Chris adds. Your place? Sarah asks. They've rigged up a sort of commune a few miles out. There's about 2,000 survivors there, Howie explains. So, if this Darren knows about the commune, are they safe? Sarah asks. We left them alone and didn't go in for the mass killing like these boys here, Chris says. We have to accept that they are able to change. We've seen them change at night and now during the day too. They can get faster when it suits them, Howie says. Howie, Sarah says urgently, causing them all to turn and look at her. She's staring at the bridge. They follow her gaze and look down to see the entire road blocked with undead. A solid and mighty gathering, assembled where the bridge meets the road. Fuck me, they did that quietly, Chris mutters. They're just standing watching, Cookie says. One of them takes a few steps forward and comes to a stop. Just over the bridge line. A symbolic passing of the threshold. That's Darren, Dave says quietly, but loud enough for everyone to hear. All the weapons are in the vehicle, Howie murmurs. Dave, are you sure that's Darren? Yes, Dave replies. It is Darren, Jamie says with confidence. Look at the way they're formed up. Perfectly spaced, Malcolm says, stepping forward to peer through the rain. Darren takes another few steps forward. What's he want? Tucker asks with fear in his voice. Fuck it. I'll go and ask him, Howie says angrily, and starts striding towards Darren as the rest of the group follow in his wake. Wait there, I'll go on my own, Howie calls back as Dave joins him at his side. OK, Mr Howie, Dave says, ignoring him. No point asking you again, is there? Not really, Dave answers. They walk down the bridge, through the rain, drawing closer to Darren, seeing the perfect lines and spaces between the undead massed before them. All of them have their heads erect as they watch the small advancing group. Howie and Dave halt a few steps away from Darren, and they all observe one another. Darren looks pale and drawn, his normally ruddy complexion already gone and the skin pulled tight across his face. He looks almost normal other than that, apart from the red bloodshot eyes that stare intently at Howie. Mr Howie, Darren says with a sneer, drawing the sound out. Nice to see you too, Darren, Howie replies casually. How are you, mate? Great. Better than ever, Darren replies quickly with a strong voice. You don't look it, mate. You look rough. No, Mr Howie he replies, drawing the sound of his name out again. I feel great. Fucking wonderful, he adds, forcefully. Darren, you're infected, mate, but you're still talking. Maybe it's not too late. We've got that doctor back in the commune and all that equipment now. If you're the first that can communicate with them and tell them how it is, they might be able to help, Howie says. Spare me the goody speech, Mr Howie. I don't need your fucking help. I think I've enough at the moment. Darren smiles and motions towards the huge horde mass behind him. So what do you want then, mate? Howie asks. You. Me? What for? Howie replies. All of you. I want all of you, and especially you. Darren stares at Howie. What for, Darren? Howie asks. I want you to fucking die. I'm going to kill you all slowly and turn you, and I'll keep a part of you alive so you know what's happening when you come back, Darren says, grinning menacingly. Why, Darren? Howie asks, forcing himself to keep his tone steady despite the anger rising inside him. You've taken so many of my kind down. Too many. 
But the tide has turned, Mr. Howie. Oh, yes. I've got an army now. And not just a bunch of fucking idiots chasing you around the country. Your kind. Darren, listen to yourself. You were part of this just a couple of hours ago. You killed them just as we did. They took our lives and our families and everything we loved. They're evil, Darren, and you don't have to be a part of them. Come back with us, mate. No, I'm not with you or your ragtag bunch of misfits. I killed them because I followed you. They only kill them because of you. Just because they took your parents. Oh, poor Howie lost his parents and now they're zombies. Poor Howie is all alone, so he decides to kill every living thing to try and rescue his whore sister. Darren laughs as he shouts. His fucking whore sister! Dirty fucking sister! He killed everything and risked the lives of everyone to rescue his dirty fucking cunt of a sister just because his parents died. An icy hand grips Howie inside, but he remains motionless, watching Darren shout and laugh as he starts to walk back and forth between Howie and the master zombie mob behind him. Oh, look, here comes Howie's heroes, a shambling fucking mess. Look at them. Darren laughs as Howie turns to see the rest of the group walking down to stand behind Howie and Dave. Oh, no! Howie's heroes have come to get me. Oh no, someone save me. Maybe your dirty cunt horse slut sister will come and rescue you, Howie. Darren screams out. Howie remains still, and despite the growing rage inside of him, he keeps his face neutral. The rest pick up on Howie's lack of reaction and remain quiet. Ah, oh, hi, Jamie. Darren waves at the quiet lad. Have you fucked Dave up the arse yet? You know you want to. Oh, and there's Tucker the fat fucker. Hey, Tucker, how many pies have you eaten yet, you fat roly-poly cunt? Ha! That's fucking funny. Tucker the fat fucker. Darren throws his head back and laughs. Then he suddenly turns back to the undead and shouts, Laugh! And thousands of undead voices start laughing hard. Darren spins back to face Howie and the group, smiling as the forced laughter erupts from behind him. He slowly raises his hand and clicks his fingers. The laughing stops instantly. Ah, oh, and there's Nick, the thick cunt who can't read or write, can you, Nick? You never got past Spot Goes to the Beach, did you, mate? Still playing with Join the Dots books, eh, Nick? Yes, Darren, Nick replies quietly. Yes, Darren! Darren mimics Nick in a high-pitched voice. And there's Blowers and Cookie. What a pair of utter cunts. Fucking playing at soldiers. Yes, Mr. Howie, and no, Mr. Howie. And can I suck your cock, Mr. Howie? Darren shouts as he walks back and forth, spittle flying from his mouth. Then he stops and stares directly at Dave. Hello, Dave, Darren says with a mock-friendly tone. How are you, Dave? Dave remains void of expression and his cold, hard eyes staring directly at Darren. Oh, are we playing the staring game, Dave? OK, mate, let's do that. Darren takes a step forward and stares hard into Dave's eyes. Dave doesn't flinch. He doesn't move a muscle and no hint of emotion escapes his cold eyes. You are a fucking little runt! Darren explodes in fury as Dave stares back without moving. You just want to fuck Howie up the arse, you fucking fag. You want to do a reach round with Howie while his dirty cunt sister licks your arse. Darren turns and starts thrusting his pelvis back and forth while stretching one arm out. That's fucking brilliant. Howie bursts out laughing as Darren spins around to face him. Howie starts applauding while laughing. Very good, mate. Have you finished? Howie asks. Don't fucking laugh at me, you cunt. I've got an army and I will not be laughed at. Darren screams and clicks his fingers. The massive horde all take a step forward perfectly in time and stamp their feet down, which booms out in the quiet air. Very impressive, mate, Howie smiles. Can you make them dance too? I don't think you should be mocking me, Mr Howie, Darren says through gritted teeth. What do you think, Dave? Should we be taking Darren seriously? Howie asks. No, Mr Howie, I don't think we should, Dave replies. 
But he has got such a big army behind him, though. What do you think, lads? Should we be taking Darren and his army seriously? Howie calls out behind him. I think they look a bit gay, Cookie replies. You'd know, Blurs replies, quick as a flash. They set off your gaydar. Blurs, it's time you stopped hiding behind the gay jokes and came out, mate, Cookie retorts. You want to hide behind me, that's for sure, Blurs replies to a few sniggers and how he smiles inside. Oi, Tucker, have you got any mince pies? I think Blurs wants one, Cookie says, laughing. Hey, Darren, do you get to choose the ones you want to bum? Nick shouts out to more sniggers and how he watches Darren's face grow darker. Chris, did you ever see such an impressive army, mate? Howie asks, drawing the big man into the conversation. Oh no, they're the biggest and the bestest I ever did see, Chris replies scathingly. And the uniform is the best we've seen yet, Malcolm adds. Darren takes a sudden step forward with his fists clenched. The group drops the laughing and takes a step towards him, which in turn makes the massive horde take another step forward. Howie and Darren lock eyes both breathing hard and staring with fixed intent. You come for me, Darren. I've killed many of them and I won't stop. I'll fucking slaughter every single one of them that I can find. So you come for me and see what happens, mate, Howie says quietly. Oh, I will, Mr Howie. I'll turn every person I can find and along the way I will leave this land ravaged and destroyed, Darren snarls back at him. They stand with eyes locked, and how he visualises ripping his throat out there and then. Night hits, and as one, the undead look to the sky and howl into the air. Thousands of voices filling the night sky, sending shivers down the spines of all the men that watch them. They start to back away, but how he stands his ground for a few more seconds, watching a slow smile form across Darren's face. Then how he leans forward and stares hard at his former friend. Roar, how he says simply, and walks away, showing his back to the horde and praying they don't cut him down. Am I the only one that wants to fucking leg it? Cookie says, as they all walk steadily back to the Saxon. No, I certainly do, Big Chris adds. So why are we walking then? Tucker asks. Don't give him the satisfaction, Clarence rumbles. Fucking run! Howie shouts as he sprints past them, causing them all to break out and start running. Howie dives into the back of the Saxon and clambers through to the driver's seat as the rest climb into the rear. They're fucking running at us! Blowers shouts as he pulls the rear doors closed with a slam. Howie starts the engine and pulls away with a jerk, sending them all lurching backwards, and Sarah falls into the laps of the men. Soon she gets her balance and stands up, suddenly becoming aware of the big men in the confined space and the very wet t-shirt that she's wearing. Uh, does anyone have a spare top? Sarah asks sweetly. A dozen tough men start scrabbling about quickly in the tight confines. Here you go, miss. Clarence speaks first, holding out a dry top to Sarah as the others all stare daggers at him. Is that my top? Nick asks, recognising the clothing. I don't know, is it? The massive man stares innocently back at Nick. Uh, maybe not, Nick adds quickly, looking up at Clarence. Chris, does that truck driver still have one of the radios? Howie shouts back. Yes, but they're only short-range things. Do you think they'll go for the commune? Chris shouts. I'm sure of it. Is that GPMG working now? Howie yells. I'll get on it, Dave replies, and climbs up to start working as the Saxon speeds up through the dark city streets. No street lights come on. None of the shops are illuminated, and there is no warm light spilling from houses or apartment blocks anymore. The rain clouds cover the night sky and cast the streets into absolute darkness. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program. This is Audible. The Undead. Day 7. By R. R. Haywood. Read by Dan Morgan. The story so far. Having a rare Friday night off work, Howie was at home when the infection breached the borders of England and soon arrived in his hometown of Boroughfair. Luck saw him through the first night when many others were taken down and infected, only to rise again as the undead. 
How he survived these encounters, lurching from catastrophe to disaster, but escaping, learning, evolving, and quickly developing a whole new set of skills. With Dave at his side, they braved the urban squalor of a ruined Portsmouth, and in so doing, Howie soon began to understand the desire to remain good in a world rapidly descending into chaos where only the strongest survive. With a plan to rescue Howie's sister from London, Howie and Dave travelled to Salisbury Army Training Barracks to find an armoured personnel carrier that would see them safely through the densely populated and infected towns that lead into the capital. Finding a group of young army recruits at the barracks, Howie quickly took charge and led the young men into the largest battle yet, killing swathes of the undead to reach the armoured vehicle he so desperately needed. The journey then led them to Big Chris, an enigmatic former soldier leading a hastily erected commune in London. Joining forces, they agreed to help each other, going first for valuable medical equipment and then to find Sarah. But the cost of rescuing Sarah may be too much. One of their own has been turned, and what comes back may be the end of everything the group have fought for. The Undead continues. Thursday. High above the surface of the earth, water vapour forms in the troposphere, and white clouds expand and quickly cast shadows over the already darkening land. Those clouds form and move with the wind, and soon cover the once vibrant city of London. The already grim-looking streets and buildings appear more despondent, as long shadows form over the bloodstains and the rotting corpses that litter the ground. The abnormally high temperatures of the last week have scorched this normally wet land. Swarms of flies and insects drift around the street, moving from corpse to corpse, laying eggs. Those eggs soon hatch in the perfect breeding ground, and the corpses look alive as thousands of fat white maggots writhe and burrow their way through the skin. The first drops of rainfall drop through the warm air to land on the windscreen of the Saxon armoured personnel carrier, driving through those grim city streets back to Tower Bridge. By the time the Saxon enters the bridge, sheets of rain are covering the surface with spray. Visibility is instantly reduced, and the Saxon slows to a stop. One by one, the men climb out from the vehicle and stand under the purifying downpour, letting the water cleanse them from the dirt of battle. Crimson pools form at their feet as the blood is sluiced from their skin and clothes. They hold their heads back, open-mouthed, and drink the cascading cool water. They wipe their hands, pull fingers through their hair, and then wring their clothes out to rid themselves of the filth and gore. The three losses they suffered are heavy on their minds and hearts, and their tears blend with the rain as they cry silently. Now they can grieve and mourn those losses. They know more hardship awaits them, and later there will not be time for mourning. Sarah stands close to the doors of the Saxon, sensing the bond between these men and realising this experience is not hers to share. She watches Howie closely and can already see the change in her brother. The goofy, playful, sweet-natured man has been replaced by a hardened warrior. She doesn't know how he came to be here or what happened along the way or why the men follow him. But she saw the reaction Howie had to the dying lad and felt the emotion in all of them as they watched him die. Sarah held Howie as he wept in the back of the vehicle and she looked around to see them all with tear-filled eyes, and that small man called Dave. He stayed by her side throughout the battle back to the Saxon, and the way he moved was extraordinary. It's clear to Sarah that there is a deep connection between her brother and Dave. Now, standing at the back of the vehicle, arms crossed and sheltering from the rain, she watches them as they stand in silence, letting the rain pour down on them. What the fuck happened, Dave? Howie asks. I don't know, Mr Howie. We were doing so well, Howie says, shaking his head. I know we lost one on the way in, but I thought we'd all be slaughtered. There were so many of them. Dave nods as Howie speaks. Why did they suddenly stop? I don't know. And what happened to Darren? He just charged them on his own. And I told McKinney to keep an eye on him and stay close. And now he's dead, Howie says, holding his hands to his forehead. It's not your fault, Mr Howie. Some people just react that way. 
Dave replies, with a rare troubled look on his face. No, that was something else, mate, Howie shakes his head. It was as if he was possessed or something. I know he'd been feeling rough, but he fought well. He was a brave lad, and to end like that was awful. Poor McKinney. Did you know his mother died just a few months ago? He told me when we were in the hospital. He said he hated hospitals because they reminded him of when his mother was sick. I took him to his death for my own gain. I led them both into it and now they're gone. Something wasn't right with Darren, Dave says quietly. Yeah, he was sick and we took him into that fight, Howie snaps back. No, I mean something wasn't right with him, Dave replies, his voice trailing off. What does that mean? I don't know. He was reckless and taking stupid risks, and he hadn't fought like that before. He kept putting himself at risk and getting away with it. We all put ourselves at risk. It was a monumentally stupid thing to do. No, they had chances to take him. I took a couple out, but I saw them holding back. What do you mean? Howie says. Dave shrugs and shakes his head. They could have had him. They had chances. The way he was overextending himself and lunging too far forward. Dave, what are you saying? Howie asks, concerned at the tone of his friend's voice. You said that he was sick. Yeah, well, we knew he was sick, Howie says, confused. He looked sick and he said he felt sick. Then he started going crazy and they were holding back on him. Maybe they were holding back on all of us. I mean, they stopped and moved back, didn't they? No, they certainly weren't holding back on me. That's what I mean. They took one of Big Chris's men down, and they took McKinney down in seconds, so why not Darren? They did take him, Howie starts to say. Did they? I didn't see it. I saw him being taken by them, but I didn't see them bite or attack him. They just enveloped him, and he was gone. And when he charged and attacked them, they didn't react. Not one of them went for him. But when McKinney got to him, they had him instantly. Dave, Howie says, shaking his head. Spit it out, mate. I don't know, but it's like they didn't want to take him. Think, Mr Howie. I know you were upset about McKinney, but you saw it. You were the closest to them, Dave says firmly. Howie looks down to the water, thinking back to just a short time ago. Darren had become very strange screaming abuse at the undead and goading them to fight him. He did charge at them, and he can't remember Darren being attacked. He clearly remembers seeing McKinney on the ground with zombies biting into him, and then how he was there with his axe, knocking them back. I didn't see Darren being attacked, but that doesn't mean he wasn't, how he says. They were both there at the front. Darren was attacking them, and McKinney was trying to stop him. We all saw that. So why kill McKinney and not Darren? I ran to them and couldn't see Darren. He was gone, Dave says. Is this a private conversation? Big Chris asks as he walks up to them. Chris, did you see what happened to Darren? Howie inquires. Those things had him, Chris answers, confused at the question. What did you see, Chris? Howie questions, staring hard at the big man as Malcolm and Clarence walk over to them. Lads, come over here, Howie calls out to the rest, and they start drifting closer until they're all standing round Howie and Dave in the pouring rain. Sarah moves closer, watching the group and the serious expression on her brother's face. Listen, I'm sorry for what happened back there. Both of our groups lost people, and watching McKinney die like that was truly awful. Howie watches as the recruit's eyes drop down, fresh tears falling. I know it's painful, but did anyone see what happened to Smithy? How he instantly regrets using the nickname they had all used for Darren. He went fucking nuts and got McKinney killed, Cookie spits out with a flash of anger, and how he watches a few of them nod in agreement. We need to think about this clearly. He was sick, right? Then he felt better. Then he was laughing and shouting as we fought. I haven't seen him do that before, but you know him better. No. Nah. He never did anything like that before, Blowers answers. Right at the end, when he charged them on his own, what did you see? Howie presses them. Sir, 
he ran forward screaming, then he started attacking them. They didn't react though, they just stood there and took it. And then McKinney tried to pull him back and he got pushed off. Then he tried again and Darren knocked him down, Jamie says. Then they went for McKinney and Darren got pulled in. The rest of the group all stare at him and he blushes from the sudden attention. Jamie, you saw all of this, Howie asks. Yes, Mr Howie, they didn't bite him or anything. They just grabbed him and he was gone. Did anyone see Darren getting bitten, Howie asks the group. What's this about, Howie? Chris asks with a serious expression. Dave says that Darren was fighting recklessly, putting himself at risk, but those things didn't go for him. They were holding back. You think he's one of them? Malcolm finally voices the unspoken thoughts. I don't know, but he was sick, then he went nuts, and they didn't go for him. How he shrugs. Fuck me, Blower says, reeling from the idea. No way, Tucker adds. He stopped firing on that fucking GPMG at the hospital too, Blower suddenly adds. He did what? Chris asks, turning on Blowers. While you lot were inside, we had a massive contact at the front. Darren was on the GPMG and he just froze up. I had to drag him down to take over. But anyone infected just goes down. I've seen it too many times, Clarence rumbles. It's a possibility, but I don't know how. He hadn't been bitten or scratched. That I saw, Howie says. So, worst case scenario, he's one of them, Chris asks. We have to consider it, Dave says firmly. They stand in silence, absorbing the idea and its implications. So, if he is one of them, does that mean anything to us? Cookie asks. Yes, replies Dave. He knows our numbers, strengths, where we're heading, the route we took, the access and egress points, Chris says. So why aren't they attacking? Blowers asks. I don't know. They stopped back there and just let us go, Howie says. Maybe they stopped so Darren would go for them, Dave adds. That would be suggesting it has some form of intelligence, said Malcolm. They knew where we were going, they massed in the exact place we were heading for, and if Darren was one of them, that explains how they knew where we were going, Howie theorised, which shows a form of intelligence. If they have intelligence, then they pulled back as a tactic. They use strategy to take what they wanted, Chris says. What for? Why would they want Darren? Tucker asks, trying to keep up. If he was the only one infected, then it would have to be him, Howie says. This is fucking ridiculous, Nick Hewitt suddenly adds. They're just fucking mindless zombies, that's all. They can't plan or make tactics. They were walking off the fucking bridge, for God's sake. It makes sense. Perfect sense, Sarah cuts in as they all turn to stare at her. Those things were outside before you came, but nowhere near the numbers they are now. They must have known where you were going and flooded the area, ready for you. And if they knew that lad was infected, then why not take him? He's one of theirs, she continues. They came for us at the services. They sent loads after us. And those people said they had gone unnoticed before we arrived. And we already said it was like we were being targeted, affirms Howie. Then they know about our place, Chris adds. Your place? Sarah asks. They've rigged up a sort of commune a few miles out. There's about 2,000 survivors there, Howie explains. So, if this Darren knows about the commune, are they safe? Sarah asks. We left them alone and didn't go in for the mass killing like these boys here. Chris says. We have to accept that they are able to change. We've seen them change at night, and now during the day, too. They can get faster when it suits them, Howie says. Howie, Sarah says urgently, causing them all to turn and look at her. She's staring at the bridge. They follow her gaze and look down to see the entire road blocked with undead. A solid and mighty gathering, assembled where the bridge meets the road. Fuck me, they did that quietly, 
Chris mutters. They're just standing watching, Cookie says. One of them takes a few steps forward and comes to a stop, just over the bridge line, a symbolic passing of the threshold. That's Darren, Dave says quietly, but loud enough for everyone to hear. All the weapons are in the vehicle, Howie murmurs. Dave, are you sure that's Darren? Yes, Dave replies. It is Darren, Jamie says with confidence. Look at the way they're formed up. Perfectly spaced, Malcolm says, stepping forward to peer through the rain. Darren takes another few steps forward. What's he want? Tucker asks with fear in his voice. Fuck it. I'll go and ask him, Howie says angrily, and starts striding towards Darren as the rest of the group follow in his wake. Wait there, I'll go on my own, Howie calls back as Dave joins him at his side. Okay, Mr Howie, Dave says, ignoring him. No point asking you again, is there? Not really, Dave answers. They walk down the bridge, through the rain, drawing closer to Darren, seeing the perfect lines and spaces between the undead massed before them. All of them have their heads erect as they watch the small advancing group. Howie and Dave halt a few steps away from Darren, and they all observe one another. Darren looks pale and drawn, his normally ruddy complexion already gone, and the skin pulled tight across his face. He looks almost normal other than that, apart from the red bloodshot eyes that stare intently at Howie. Mr Howie! Darren says with a sneer, drawing the sound out. Nice to see you too, Darren, Howie replies casually. How are you, mate? Great. Better than ever, Darren replies quickly with a strong voice. You don't look it, mate. You look rough. No, Mr Howie, he replies, drawing the sound of his name out again. I feel great. Fucking wonderful, he adds forcefully. Darren... You're infected, mate, but you're still talking. Maybe it's not too late. We've got that doctor back in the commune and all that equipment now. If you're the first that can communicate with them and tell them how it is, they might be able to help, Howie says. Spare me the goody speech, Mr Howie. I don't need your fucking help. I think I've enough at the moment. Darren smiles and motions towards the huge horde mass behind him. So what do you want then, mate? Howie asks. You. Me? What for? Howie replies. All of you. I want all of you, and especially you. Darren stares at Howie. What for, Darren? Howie asks. I want you to fucking die. I'm going to kill you all slowly and turn you, and I'll keep a part of you alive so you know what's happening when you come back, Darren says, grinning menacingly. Why, Darren? Howie asks, forcing himself to keep his tone steady, despite the anger rising inside him. You've taken so many of my kind down. Too many. But the tide has turned, Mr Howie. Oh yes, I've got an army now. And not just a bunch of fucking idiots chasing you around the country. Your kind. Darren, listen to yourself. You were part of this just a couple of hours ago. You killed them just as we did. They took our lives and our families and everything we loved. They're evil, Darren, and you don't have to be a part of them. Come back with us, mate. No, I'm not with you or your ragtag bunch of misfits. I killed them because I followed you. They only kill them because of you. Just because they took your parents. Oh, poor Howie lost his parents, and now they're zombies. Poor Howie is all alone, so he decides to kill every living thing to try and rescue his whore sister. Darren laughs as he shouts. His fucking whore sister! Dirty fucking sister! He killed everything and risked the lives of everyone to rescue his dirty fucking cunt of a sister just because his parents died. An icy hand grips Howie inside, but he remains motionless, watching Darren shout and laugh as he starts to walk back and forth between Howie and the master zombie mob behind him. Oh, look, here comes Howie's heroes, a shambling fucking mess. Look at them. Darren laughs as Howie turns to see the rest of the group walking down to stand behind Howie and Dave. 
Oh no, Howie's heroes have come to get me. Oh no, someone save me. Maybe your dirty cunt horse slut sister will come and rescue you, Howie. Darren screams out. Howie remains still, and despite the growing rage inside of him, he keeps his face neutral. The rest pick up on Howie's lack of reaction and remain quiet. Ah, oh, hi, Jamie. Darren waves at the quiet lad. Have you fucked Dave up the arse yet? You know you want to. Oh, and there's Tucker the fat fucker. Hey, Tucker, how many pies have you eaten yet, you fat roly-poly cunt? Ha! That's fucking funny. Tucker the fat fucker. Darren throws his head back and laughs. Then he suddenly turns back to the undead and shouts, Laugh! And thousands of undead voices start laughing hard. Darren spins back to face Howie and the group, smiling as the forced laughter erupts from behind him. He slowly raises his hand and clicks his fingers. The laughing stops instantly. Ah, oh, and there's Nick, the thick cunt who can't read all right, can you, Nick? You never got past Spot Goes to the Beach, did you, mate? Still playing with Join the Dots books, eh, Nick? Yes, Darren, Nick replies quietly. Yes, Darren. Darren mimics Nick in a high-pitched voice. And there's Blowers and Cookie. What a pair of utter cunts. Fucking playing at soldiers. Yes, Mr Howie, and no, Mr Howie. And can I suck your cock, Mr Howie? Darren shouts as he walks back and forth, spittle flying from his mouth. Then he stops and stares directly at Dave. Hello, Dave, Darren says with a mock-friendly tone. How are you, Dave? Dave remains void of expression and his cold, hard eyes staring directly at Darren. Oh, are we playing the staring game, Dave? OK, mate, let's do that. Darren takes a step forward and stares hard into Dave's eyes. Dave doesn't flinch. He doesn't move a muscle and no hint of emotion escapes his cold eyes. You're a fucking little runt! Darren explodes in fury as Dave stares back without moving. You just want to fuck Howie up the arse, you fucking fag. You want to do a reach round with Howie while his dirty cunt sister licks your arse. Darren turns and starts thrusting his pelvis back and forth while stretching one arm out. That's fucking brilliant. Howie bursts out laughing as Darren spins around to face him. Howie starts applauding while laughing. Very good, mate. Have you finished? Howie asks. Don't fucking laugh at me, you cunt. I've got an army and I will not be laughed at. Darren screams and clicks his fingers. The massive horde all take a step forward perfectly in time and stamp their feet down, which booms out in the quiet air. Very impressive, mate, Howie smiles. Can you make them dance too? I don't think you should be mocking me, Mr Howie, Darren says through gritted teeth. What do you think, Dave? Should we be taking Darren seriously? Howie asks. No, Mr Howie, I don't think we should, Dave replies. But he has got such a big army behind him, though. What do you think, lads? Should we be taking Darren and his army seriously? Howie calls out behind him. I think they look a bit gay, Cookie replies. You'd know, Blurs replies, quick as a flash. They set off your gaydar. Blurs, it's time you stopped hiding behind the gay jokes and came out, mate, Cookie retorts. You want to hide behind me, that's for sure, Blurs replies to a few sniggers, and how he smiles inside. Oi, Tucker, have you got any mince pies? I think Blurs wants one, Cookie says, laughing. Hey, Darren, do you get to choose the ones you want to bum? Nick shouts out to more sniggers, and how he watches Darren's face grow darker. Chris, did you ever see such an impressive army, mate? How he asks, drawing the big man into the conversation. Oh no, they're the biggest and the bestest I ever did see, Chris replies scathingly. And the uniform is the best we've seen yet, Malcolm adds. Darren takes a sudden step forward with his fists clenched. The group drops the laughing and takes a step towards him, which in turn makes the massive horde take another step forward. Howie and Darren lock eyes, both breathing hard and staring with fixed intent. You come for me, Darren. I've killed many of them and I won't stop. I'll fucking slaughter every single one of them that I can find. So you come for me and see what happens, mate, Howie says quietly. 
Oh, I will, Mr. Howie. I'll turn every person I can find, and along the way I will leave this land ravaged and destroyed. Darren snarls back at him. They stand with eyes locked, and Howie visualises ripping his throat out there and then. Night hits, and as one, the undead look to the sky and howl into the air. Thousands of voices filling the night sky, sending shivers down the spines of all the men that watch them. They start to back away, but Howie stands his ground for a few more seconds, watching a slow smile form across Darren's face. Then Howie leans forward and stares hard at his former friend. Roar, Howie says simply, and walks away, showing his back to the horde and praying they don't cut him down. Am I the only one that wants to fucking leg it? Cookie says, as they all walk steadily back to the Saxon. No, I certainly do, Big Chris adds. So why are we walking then? Tucker asks. Don't give him the satisfaction, Clarence rumbles. Fucking run! Howie shouts as he sprints past them, causing them all to break out and start running. Howie dives into the back of the Saxon and clambers through to the driver's seat as the rest climb into the rear. They're fucking running at us, Blower shouts as he pulls the rear doors closed with a slam. Howie starts the engine and pulls away with a jerk, sending them all lurching backwards, and Sarah falls into the laps of the men. Soon she gets her balance and stands up, suddenly becoming aware of the big men in the confined space and the very wet t-shirt that she's wearing. Uh, does anyone have a spare top? Sarah asks sweetly. A dozen tough men start scrabbling about quickly in the tight confines. Here you go, miss. Clarence speaks first, holding out a dry top to Sarah as the others all stare daggers at him. Is that my top? Nick asks, recognising the clothing. I don't know, is it? The massive man stares innocently back at Nick. Uh, maybe not, Nick adds quickly, looking up at Clarence. Chris, does that truck driver still have one of the radios? Howie shouts back. Yes, but they're only short-range things. Do you think they'll go for the commune? Chris shouts. I'm sure of it. Is that GPMG working now? Howie yells. I'll get on it, Dave replies and climbs up to start working as the Saxon speeds up through the dark city streets. No street lights come on. None of the shops are illuminated and there is no warm light spilling from houses or apartment blocks anymore. The rain clouds cover the night sky and cast the streets into absolute darkness. The powerful headlights shine out like beacons in the darkness, and the zombies surge towards them like moths. The solid plated front of the Saxon hardly rocks as they plough through body after body. The zombies bare their teeth as they lunge to the front of the vehicle. Should we be shooting them down from the back doors? Tucker asks. No, we're going too fast, and it's not worth it for dropping just a few of them. We need to get back as soon as possible, Chris says, with worry clearly in his voice. How secure is it, Chris? Will it withstand a mass attack? Howie shouts back. No, we can hold against a few of them at a time, but we've only been going a few days. A big push would get them through easily. Can we make it more secure? Howie asks. If they're coming for us with large numbers, we'll have to bug out. Can't repel them, and we don't have time to secure it more, Chris shouts back. How soon can they make ready to leave then? Howie asks. It'll take hours. We don't have enough vehicles, and we've got kids and sick people too. I don't think we have ours, Chris. They move fast at night, and he knows where it is now. He can send them in to attack it. Chris looks to Malcolm and his men. They have family and friends at the commune. Fighting huge hordes of the undead in hand-to-hand -hand combat is one thing, but now there is a direct threat against the people he offered safety and security to. Are all those forts big enough for all of us? Malcolm calls out. I don't know. It depends how many have already gone there and how full they are. They are big, though, especially the main one, Howie replies. Is there anywhere else we can go? Easy to defend and hold many people? Clarence asks. Probably loads of places, but I don't know of them, Howie shouts back. We need to make a decision, Chris. We'll have to move out as soon as we get back, Malcolm says. OK. We'll go for the forts, women and children into whatever vehicles we can find. There's still space in the truck we can use, Chris says. They've probably started to unload it already, Clarence joins in. 
We'll have to take essential equipment only and use the rest of the space for people. We've also got the trucks that we used as barriers across the access roads, Chris says, thinking as he goes along. Right, Malcolm, I want you to arrange the vehicles, get those trucks ready and lined up on the exit road. Clarence, I want you to sort the hospital out. Don't take any shit from Doc Roberts and make sure he only takes essential items. Chris barks out. Got it, Clarence nods. Howie, can we use the Saxon at the rear access road to cover if we get the GPMG working again? Chris asks. I'll get it working, Dave calls down. Okay, Saxon at the rear with Nick on the GPMG, Jamie as sniper, blowers, Cookie and Sarah, I want you with the vehicles to help load the people up. They'll be scared and confused, so be nice, but get them moving, Howie calls out to nods and yells of affirmation. Chris, do you have a stores area? Howie asks. Yes, he replies. One of our blokes excels in that area, can you make use of him to help organise? Yes, definitely, Chris shouts back. Tucker? That's you. On it, Tucker shouts back. Dave, me and you will stick with Chris to work from a central point. We stay put, so everyone knows where we are, so they can come to us. That okay with everyone? Sarah watches as the men and lads all shout out in acknowledgement. Then she looks at Chris, a naturally big man with a dark beard and very white teeth. He has an air of natural leadership about him. He and the older men are clearly ex-soldiers. When they took their tops off in the rain, she saw the scars on their bodies. Bullet holes and knife slashes, long-heeled but still very visible. Clarence is a huge man mountain with muscles on top of muscles, but with a kind face. Then she looks to her brother. Less than a week ago, he was working nights in a supermarket. Always a kind man, fun-loving and very caring. But now there is a hardness to him, and these men respond to him and listen to what he's saying. Her brother is giving orders in a manner that just makes them want to follow him. She had watched as he stayed at the front, fighting towards her, and then went back again, swinging that axe with a look of pure fury and hatred on his face. And these battle-hardened men and young lads are following him. She can see the difference in him, the way he uses humour and kind words, but then gives an order that leaves no doubt it will be followed. And the thing is, it all makes sense. He shows respect to Big Chris, knowing that the big man is the leader of his group. But Sarah suspects that even if he hadn't shown that respect, they would still have accepted what he said. Life has changed. The whole world has changed. And her brother has changed the most. He walked alone towards a huge horde of undead back on the bridge. Maybe he did feel fear, but he faced it and walked towards it. She knows he came for her, and now that he has saved her... He could turn tail and run away, but even now, he's accepted the responsibility of trying to save those other people. They're nothing to him, and these young lads don't hold any loyalty to them, or Howie, but they accept what he says without question. She feels an immense sense of pride in her brother. She felt pride in him before, just for being a good person. But now, now he shines with a glowing light. He is amazing. He's a good man a rich voice in tones, and she snaps out of her reverie to see Clarence smiling at her. What? Your brother. He's a good man. A natural leader, he repeats. Yeah, I guess he is, she smiles back at him. Hold on tight, Howie yells as the Saxon slams into a horde gathered in the road. The impact at such high speed sends the Saxon rocking on its suspension, causing them all to slide and fall in the back. A huge hand shoots out and grabs Sarah around the waist to prevent her falling back. Thanks. Again, Sarah says to Clarence. There's more, Howie bellows, and the Saxon rocks and jolts as it slams into body after body, pulverising them instantly from the raw power of the impact. The Saxon careers through the streets as Howie negotiates the bends and turns. Zombies launch themselves into the oncoming vehicle, screaming as they run and lunge forward, only to be splattered against the front like flies. Big group! Howie yells as the lights pick up an oncoming horde running full tilt at the Saxon. Howie pushes his foot down hard, and the big engines roar out into the night as the vehicle surges forward. Howie grips the wheel and growls deep in his throat. Brace! he screams as they impact. A horde of undead zombies play chicken with an armour-plated military vehicle. The result? 
is devastation, with bodies exploding as they strike the corners and skulls imploding on the solid metal being driven into them at speed. They really don't like us anymore, Howie shouts back as they continually slam into the living corpses. Have we done something to upset them? Cookie asks. I got fed up with you touching them, Blower says to loud groans from everyone else. He smiles around at them. What? Please don't start again, Tucker whines. Hey, don't tell me, tell Cookie. I only say what I see, Blowers replies. Blowers, you are homophobic and I find it offensive, Cookie says in a serious tone, causing a few of the others to burst out laughing. Homophobic? Me? Blowers says back at him. You are homophobic and you offend me and you could offend some of these new people with those nasty comments, Cookie says, retaining his serious tone to more laughs. Who am I going to offend? Blowers laughs back at him. Me, a rich, deep voice says from behind him. Blowers turns to stare up at Clarence, who in turn stares back down with a very serious expression. You? Blowers asks. You're not gay? He adds. Aren't I? Uh, are you? Blowers asks, looking up at the huge man. Clarence stares back in silence, a silence that is only broken by the thumps and bangs as the Saxon hits more zombies. Uh, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean anything. I, I was just, um, Blowers stammers, unaware of Big Chris, Malcolm and the other men all smiling behind him. Blowers keeps going for several seconds, stuttering and stammering his words while staring up at the imposing face of Clarence. Clarence suddenly bursts out laughing like a braying donkey with his deep voice and they all erupt as Blowers glares around at them. Piss off, I knew he wasn't gay, Blowers shouts out. Do you shit yourself, mate, Cookie says, wiping tears from his eyes. Even Sarah laughs at Clarence's deep braying. Never seen you nervous before, Blowers? Nick laughs at him. Yeah, very funny, very funny, Blowers mutters and starts laughing himself. The Saxon drives through the night until it reaches the road, leading to the rear of the commune. Within seconds of arriving in the area, the undead suddenly stop attacking them, standing still, but leaning forward to scream and bare their teeth as the vehicle roars past them. Why are they holding back? Sarah asks, leaning forward to look through the windscreen. We're right near the commune. They must be waiting to gather more numbers before attacking, Howie shouts back. There's no other reason I can think of. The entrance is in sight, Chris. Are we safe to go straight in? Howie yells. Yes, they'll recognise the vehicle, he shouts back. GPMG is sorted, Dave says as he drops back down. I've cleaned it the best I can too. Right, if they're starting to mass, we need to move very quickly. Nick, get on that GPMG. You're with Jamie here. The rest need to get moving, Howie shouts as the vehicle pulls up in front of the truck parked across the road. Big Chris jumps out of the back and shouts for the truck to be moved as he strides forward. Within seconds, the gap opens and the Saxon pulls through. We'll leave it here. Curtis, you stay with them, mate. They might need a driver for it, Howie says as they all get out and start moving off to their allocated positions. Chris is surrounded by people coming to greet them. He silences them all by holding his hands up in the air. We will be attacked very soon, he says loudly and simply. We have to get everyone out, and we need to do it now. Get those trunks turned round and every vehicle we have down to the front. Chris turns to a few of his men. I want you to start sweeping down. Do it quickly, but thoroughly. Get everyone you can find to help you. Get them all to the front, ready to get on the vehicles. Women and children first. No stopping to get toys or clothes. We will be overrun very soon, and we must move quickly. Do it now, Chris urges as they start sprinting away. He turns back to the guard, still standing by the access point. You lads, you heard what I said? We've got the Saxon here and a couple of lads with it, but I need you to stay and hold this area. Take this radio and keep me updated if you get contact. Got it? They nod back and turn to stare out. Nick climbs up through the lookout position and turns the machine gun around to face back down the road. Jamie and Curtis sit inside the back of the vehicle, facing down the road with their rifles aimed and ready. Howie, Dave and Big Chris start striding down the main road as his men move quickly ahead of him, darting in and out of the buildings. All down the wide main street, people start running about with panicked looks, grabbing at children and pulling them along. As soon as Chris comes into view, they aim straight for him. 
I'm sorry, I don't have time for this. Get ready and get down to the front, Chris repeats over and over again, his voice staying calm. The truck they used to transport equipment from the hospital in Canary Wharf back to the commune is resting in the main road. The rear doors are open wide and half the equipment has already been carried into the makeshift hospital. Howie looks over at the building as they pass and sees Dr Roberts with his shaggy eyebrows peering out at them. Chris, what's going on? Doc Roberts walks swiftly towards them, his long white coat flapping out behind him. Doc, we're going to be overrun very soon. Get loaded with whatever you can grab and get it down the front, Chris calls back. Right, the doctor calls out without breaking his stride, a man used to processing information very quickly and reacting without panic. He turns to stride back inside the hospital, barking orders to people as he goes. They reach the pub on the corner, amidst scenes of bedlam, people shouting and torches flashing as men run back and forth. The refugees scurry towards the assembly point, all of them clearly terrified. Children scream and cry as desperate parents cajole and snap at them to move faster and keep up. Armed men and women run through the masses towards Chris, taking instructions and are told where to position themselves. Howie assists where he can, diverting questions from terrified residents and urging them to move quickly. The truck from the rear entrance point drives slowly past them, followed by more vehicles taken from the commune's hastily gathered collection. I think you'll be needing these. A woman appears, carrying a tray with three steaming mugs of coffee, a small pot of sugar next to them on the tray. She puts the tray down on one of the wooden bench seats outside the pub, and Howie sees Chris smile for the first time since they got back. Thanks, love. Are you ready to go? Chris asks gently, drawing the woman into his arms. I'll be ready when you are, she replies, smiling up at him. I suppose there's no point in asking you to get down the front, is there? I suppose you know the answer to that, she replies quickly, but still with a smile. How was it out there? she adds. Bloody awful, he replies. A man marches towards Chris. Howie steps out to intercept him, trying to give the big man a moment of privacy. Hi, can I help you? Howie asks in his best supermarket manager's voice. I want to know what's going on. We were told we were safe here. Contact at rear entrance! Dave's and Chris's radios boom out. Chris to rear entrance. What have you got there? Lots of zombies. They're staring at us from the end of the road. Looks like they're getting ready. Permission to engage. The infection has mutated far beyond anything it was ever designed or cultured to be. Up until now, each host has been completely consumed by the virus working into every cell of the body. This method worked well, but it had limitations that the infection was only too aware of. But now the mutation has become extreme. Darren has ceased being a human and has been completely infected. But rather than destroying every part of Darren, the infection worked to integrate with him keeping memories, skills and a lifetime of learning and allowing Darren access to anything that will help the cause while denying any sense of guilt or remorse. The greatest advancement by the infection has been the ability to strictly control the flow of memories and instincts. But, more than this, it is the mastering of the chemical hormones that control these bodies. These chemicals excreted throughout the human system control every emotion and every possible feeling that can be experienced. The infection has learnt that these bodies can be controlled by using electrical impulses to the muscles, and they can be given a primary function of seeking new hosts. But those hormones and chemicals make the difference between a human and a deeply feeling person. Every pocket of resistance around the world suddenly finds themselves facing a disciplined and organised army of undead. Hordes gather at the entry points and, rather than attacking prematurely, they wait in silence and with patience, concentrating on the resistors who have killed the most hosts, for they must be stopped. In London, Darren walks with a fast pace through the streets towards the commune, at the head of a huge trailing army of zombies, each of them walking with purpose and a fixed stare. The infection floods them with chemicals that make them aggressive and angry, They growl and roar as they stalk through the streets, fighting the ever-increasing urge to break free and race forward to take the resistors down. The zombies ahead of them hold and wait for the head of the army to pass, roaring out with loyalty as Darren walks by them. 
He doesn't flinch, but stares ahead with a determined glare on his face, fixed on images of Howie dying painfully and that whore sister of his being ripped apart, and Dave being slowly tortured and begging for his life with his dying breath. Darren also conjures up images of Blowers and Cookie being made to humiliate and degrade themselves with disgusting sex acts before they too become killed and are turned into his loyal subjects. Jamie Reese having his eyes gouged out. Tucker being force-fed human flesh. One by one, he thinks through his former comrades and dreams of ways of torturing and killing them slowly. But the one that matters the most is Howie. And Darren will not stop until he can slaughter his sister in front of him, slaughter every one of them in front of him, and then slowly turn Howie. The infection inside him revels in the power and the sudden organisation using this host has brought and it knows the resistor's time is now very limited. Darren sends the undead to the access points of the commune and holds them in position. He has learnt that a coordinated and focused attack on many points will be far harder to repel. Learning the skills of survival, strategy and tactics from Dave, he now puts those to use and holds the undead army in the shadows. Darren knows that the increasing numbers standing just close enough to be seen will send fear and dread through the people in the commune. They will be panicked and make mistakes and be far harder to control. Not like his loyal subjects, who are easy to control and bend to his will, but those people, those feeble people, will panic and scream in fear, which will only make his zombie warriors fight harder to get at them. The infection has also learnt that the more speed he applies to the hosts, the less power and strength they have. Even at night, if the infection can hold them at a steady pace rather than an all-out reckless charge, they will have greater energy for the killing and the taking of more hosts. Big Chris, Howie and Dave stand outside the pub, receiving a constant flow of intelligence from the eyes and ears placed all around the perimeter. The undead are massing at nearly every access point, but they hold and wait. This knowledge spreads like wildfire through the area, and people start running and screaming in panic, fearing they will be attacked at any minute. That fucker knows what he's doing, Howie says bitterly. Maybe we should open up on them, start cutting the numbers down. I think we should, better than waiting for them to go for us, Chris says. No, we'll keep loading the people up. If they attack now and break through, we'll get overrun. Every minute they hold off buys us time, Dave says firmly. Chris to all units and access points. Do not engage until they attack. Do not prompt them to attack. Hold positions and wait. I'm going down the front to see how they're getting on, Howie says, feeling frustrated. He walks off with Dave stepping beside him. Mate, this is nuts, Howie says, shaking his head. It is. Fucking Darren, did you see him back there? He was fucking demented and twisted up, poor lad. Do you feel sorry for him? Dave asks. Sort of. Don't get me wrong, though. I'll fucking kill him the first chance I get, but still. Still what? You know, we knew him. He was one of us, and that doesn't just go away. Oh, yes, of course, Dave replies. Dave, have you ever had anything like this happen before? Howie asks. You mean, having the world end from a zombie outbreak, fighting across the country in an armoured personnel carrier training vehicle in order to rescue a woman, and then fighting back out? while well, one of my men gets turned into one of the aforementioned zombies. No, I haven't. Quite a long speech from Dave. Howie's influence was wearing off on him. Funny fucker. I meant have you ever had one of yours turn against you? Harry laughs. Yes, it does happen. Blokes get paid off, or offered other things to go rogue, Dave replies. What did you do? I killed them, Dave says. Makes sense. Howie nods as they reach the end of the row of vehicles and sees Blowers and Cookie urging people into a line and then sending them forward to the vehicles as they pull forward. How's it going, lads? Howie asks as he walks up. Bloody nightmare, Mr Howie. Everyone's going crazy. We've got them in a line here and send them forward to Sarah at the vehicles. She's helping to get them loaded and shouting when the next one's ready, Blowers replies. We've got loads into the first truck. If we can get them down there, we'll shift them a lot quicker, Cookie adds, as he waves the approaching people into the line. Move over to the line, please. We will get you away very soon, he yells out. Harry to Chris. We need the trucks down front. We've got too many people here waiting for vehicles, Harry says into the radio. 
Chris, to any units listening, get those trucks down to the front as a priority. His voice returns on the radio. Clarence to Chris, I'm on it now. Doc Roberts has got half his truck filled. I'll get them down to you now. Clarence's deep voice booms out. Within minutes, the huge bald man is walking down the road ahead of two trucks. He steps aside and waves them towards the front of the vehicle line. Sarah steps out of the vehicles and stands in front of the first truck, waving her arms high to stop it. Hold it there! Blowers and Cookie, get those people into the back of this one first! She yells out, with a calm and confident voice. Got it! Blowers shouts back. Your sister takes after you then, Mr Howie, Blowers says with a smile. She's bossier than me, mate. She'll be running the show within an hour, Howie laughs back. Okay, listen up, people. We need to get you into the truck. Women and children first. Stay calm, Cookie shouts out as the crowd starts surging towards the rear. Howie walks around to see Clarence and Sarah at the back doors of the truck, helping people up. A constant surge against them as the panicked people try to clamber in. Move back and wait, Clarence shouts out to no effect, and Howie nods at Dave. You will wait and move calmly! Dave's voice booms out into the air, silencing the entire area as everyone turns to look. Cheers, Dave. Clarence rumbles with a smile as he and Sarah return to helping lift people up into the back. Questions are thrown at them, and children scream as they are pushed up into the darkness of the back of the truck. The first vehicle gets filled and Sarah rushes to the front to wave it on, while Clarence waves the next one in. The rear doors are already open, with Dr. Robert standing there, still in his white lab coat. My staff are already in here. We'll stand across the back to protect the equipment, Doc Roberts says, not so much a question as a statement. We're doing well, Sarah calls out, considering how many people are here and the lack of time. Crystal units, the access points are reporting mass numbers now. Get them people out, do it now. The urgency in his voice is clear. I'm sending more vehicles down now. On cue, headlights appear down the road and the sound of diesel engines of vans and small delivery trucks fills the air. The group waves them down and sends the people into the back of them. The waiting crowd has thinned down considerably, which makes it easier to manage the loading. Latecomers run down to the area to join the people cramming into vehicles. A small truck then appears and pulls up next to Howie and Sarah. Tucker's face peers out from the passenger window. Supply vehicle, Mr Howie, Tucker says. Bloody hell, mate, that was quick, Howie answers, impressed. They were well organised. Well, sort of. Well, they are now, anyway, he laughs. Is it okay if I stay with this vehicle? They'll need an armed escort. Good idea, mate. Get in the middle somewhere. Do not be the first or last vehicle in the convoy, Howie yells as the vehicle rolls forward. There are many vehicles stretching back into the main street, loaded with refugees. Headlights shine into the night, casting deep shadows and making the guards cover their eyes as they look up and down. A deep roar splits the air from all around them, deep and guttural and truly terrifying. Here they come, Howie calls out as the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. The roaring ends as the sound of gunfire erupts from all the access points at the same time. Small arms and automatic weapons spit out, alongside the distinctive sound of the GPMG at the far end. Form a line across here, Howie bellows out, pointing at armed men and indicating a section of road back from the refugees who are still waiting to get loaded. Men and women run into position and stand across the road, facing out with grim faces and shaky hands. Cookie and Blowers run in the middle. Now experienced and hardened from the battles they've faced, they stand still, calmly. Both of them feel the exhilaration and excitement that comes the minutes before the fighting starts. Without speaking, they take magazines from their bags and lay them down face up on the road in front of them, checking their rifles and assuming a kneeling position. The experienced ex-soldiers and police officers look down to see their actions and quickly copy them. Within minutes... There is a line of armed men and women stretching out, kneeling in front of spare magazines, weapons ready. Cookie, Blowers says. Yes, mate, he answers. Don't try and bum them this time. Oh, that's not fair, Cookie says. Well, maybe just one then. Okay, mate, just one, I promise. Thanks, mate, Blowers replies. 
and the rest of the men and women look at them, seeing them joking with easy banter, even knowing what they are about to face. How he looks at them with an immense sense of pride. Clarence, you and Sarah keep loading those vehicles. We've got seconds now. Howie shouts back at them from his position behind the line, Dave standing at his side. Rear access point to all units. We're getting overrun. We are pulling back. We will move slowly down the main road. There are fucking thousands of them. Chris to all units, start pulling back towards the vehicle form-up point. Staggered fallback. Keep them suppressed. Malcolm to Chris, we're running out of room in the vehicle form-up point. We need to start pulling out, but once we start, we're not stopping. Chris to Malcolm, roger that. Chris to Clarence, are we loaded and ready? Clarence to Chris, we're not loaded, but we're almost there. Clarence to Malcolm, start rolling out slowly. Keep it slow, we'll throw them in as you move past. Malcolm to Clarence, roger that. We're starting to roll out now. I need guards to the front. Chris to units, get guards to the front in support of Malcolm on point position. Clarence to Chris, I cannot spare any guards from my position. Can you take them from the access points? Chris to Clarence, that's a negative. They are doing a fighting withdrawal. They are swamped. Howie to Chris, we can send every third person from our line and move them to the front. That gives you about four guards. Is that enough? Malcolm to Howie. Roger that. Just send two. We will work on speed and momentum. Get that Saxon to the front when you can. Howie to Malcolm. Roger that. Two guards on way to you now. Chris to rear access point Saxon. Did you copy the last from Malcolm? Rear access point Saxon to Chris. Roger that. Fighting retreat down the road and then we move to point position. Blowers, get two from the line and send them to the front in support of Malcolm until the Saxon can take point, Howie shouts out as Blowers jumps up and motions to two people within the line. They are both much older than the 19-year-old Territorial Army recruit, but they accept his orders without question and sprint down towards the front of the vehicles. Howie stands watching back down the road, then turns to see Clarence and Sarah pushing people into the backs of vans and small trucks and shouting at the drivers to move on. The fleet starts to move slowly, being held by Malcolm at the front. Move! Clarence's voice booms out as he starts picking people up to push them into vehicles. Sarah lacks the physical strength, but her strong character and force of personality achieves the same aim, and she shouts, bellows, and urges them into the vehicles. Here they come! Blowers shouts from the line. Howie spins around to see the Saxons slowly rolling towards them the GPMG firing constantly from the top. We hold this line, Howie shouts out. Let the Saxon through, and we hold this line until those people are loaded. We will not fail. We will hold. Yes, sir, Blowers and Cookie chorus back. Do you hear me? We hold this line. Yes, sir, voices from the line shout back at him as Howie feels the adrenaline start to surge through his system. He spins back to look at Clarence. They make eye contact, and Howie raises two fingers to his own eyes, and then points at Sarah. You watch her for me. Clarence nods once and goes back to pushing people into the vehicles. We are not scared. We do not feel fear. We are good, and they are evil, and we will not fail. We will hold this line, Howie roars out. The Saxon draws close and flashes the headlights. Cookie and Blowers move to the side and create a gap for the Saxon to pull through. Once the back of the vehicle passes the line, they close up and form a kneeling position. Howie and Dave run to the line and take up positions between Blowers and Cookie, kneeling down and looking up to the solid wall of undead zombies marching towards them. Fucking have it! Howie roars and opens up with his assault rifle. The GPMG pauses as Nick bellows, Magazine! The line opens up as every weapon starts firing. Bright muzzle flashes light the dark sky and the oncoming horde starts dropping. Bullets rip through the zombies, tearing them apart. They drop many and keep killing as they get closer and closer. Magazine! Blower shouts, and within seconds he has expelled one and snatched one from the ground, rammed it home, slammed the bolt back and opens up. We're coming in, Chris shouts down the radio, as Howie sees groups of men and women running into the main road from the side junctions, firing behind them. Cease fire, Howie shouts, and the line all drop their weapons. But Howie can see the reduction in fire rate stops the killing, and every step of the zombie army brings them closer and closer. 
We advance on me, Howie stands and pauses for a second to allow the men and women to grab the magazines in front of them. Howie paces forward with deliberate steps, watching as the line walks with him. The guards from the access points run down the big road with Big Chris leading them, turning to fire back as the side junction suddenly becomes stacked with zombies marching out to meet the main horde. Hold! Howie shouts, and they all drop down again as the access point guards stream past them. Fire! Howie roars, and they again open up on the horde, giving the retreating access point guards a few seconds to move back to the Saxon. Pull back! Chris shouts out, and as one, the line stands to start stepping backwards, each man and woman firing as they go. Voices shout, Magazine! as they eject and ram new ones home. The fire rate is devastating, and the front ranks of the zombie army are torn down under the deadly hail of bullets. Hold! Howie shouts as they reach the back of the Saxon. Are you ready, Nick? Howie shouts behind him. Yes! Nick shouts down as the GPMG opens up. One heavy calibre machine gun and two lines of men and women firing automatic weapons slaughter the oncoming zombies. They're shredded as they walk and the massive fire rate devastates them. Attack from the rear! Dave's voice booms out and Howie spins to see zombies surging into the vehicle area. Chris, get those vehicles moving now, Howie screams as he leans into the Saxon and draws his axe out. He pauses and grabs the other double-bladed axe and starts running towards Clarence, who is fighting them with his bare hands. The huge man grabs them as they swarm at him, throwing them aside as he roars and screams with violence. Dave is at Howie's side, his knives drawn. Cookie and blowers run on the other side of Howie, bayonets in hand. Howie looks ahead and watches Sarah pushing the last few people into the backs of vehicles. They run faster, seeing more of the zombies going towards Sarah as she pushes the last one into the vehicle and slams the rear doors closed. Sarah, go with the vehicle, Howie bellows out. She turns back to see four undead striding towards her and she backs into the vehicle, becoming trapped against the closed doors. The zombies spread out in a line only a few steps away from her. Howie screams and sprints with all his strength. A deep roar drowns every other noise as Clarence picks a zombie up and throws him high into the air, then charges the line of four undead with his shoulder dropped down. The man mountain powers into the first one and drives through the rest, scooping them up on the way. Clarence bowls them over so they are underneath him, then his arms pull back and start piling in massive punches to the zombie heads beneath him. Clarence roars and those fists lift up and drive down again and again as he pulverises the skulls. They don't stand a chance and the big man kills them all, then stands up to run back to Sarah. He lifts Sarah by her waist and opens the rear door of the van, pushes her in, then takes a small black item from his back pocket and presses it into her hand before slamming the door closed. Move now! Clarence slams his hand on the side of the vehicle, causing it to rock on its suspension, and the vehicle pulls away with squealing tyres. Finally, he looks back at Howie, and they nod once to each other as Howie hands him the axe. They turn to face out towards the oncoming zombies, both holding their axes with faces drawn with intensity. Howie launches forward and starts driving them down, swinging the blades through their heads and necks. Brains burst apart and blood pours out from necks as Dave whips through them, slicing them apart. Jamie comes running in with his knives held the same way as Dave. He drops down and starts slicing into the backs of legs, cutting through tendons and ligaments. Zombies drop down from the deadly wounds to writhe on the floor, only to be stamped on by Clarence's huge boots. The vehicles slowly pull away as the men fight amongst them, battling to keep the zombies away from the vehicles and the people within them. The last vehicle leaves the compound, a row of bright red lights reflecting off the wet ground, and headlights dimming as they draw away into the inky night. The small group backs away towards the line behind them, keeping pace with each other and fighting out as the zombies come at them sporadically. Howie slashes out, swinging the axe in a vicious uppercut and driving the blade straight through the thrusting chin of an undead male, bursting his face apart in a spray of blood, bone and teeth. They reach the Saxon, and Howie looks out to see the carpet of slaughtered undead. They're pulling back, Chris shouts over as the group take position around the Saxon. I'm not surprised, you've bloody killed them all. 
how he shouts back, to see Chris give a big grin, his white teeth gleaming in stark contrast to his dark beard. The Saxon can't fit us all in. We need more vehicles, Howie shouts. His voice is drowned out by the weapons firing all around him. He walks around to stand near Chris and repeats his concern. There's a couple of things we might be able to use at the end of the barricade. We left the keys in the glove boxes of the ones we might need, Chris replies. But they're all piled up. They'll be fucked, Howie says. No, there's some right at the beginning. I know which ones. We'll have to work our way down there, Chris says. There's not so many of them now, he adds, looking up the road. Howie looks up to see small groups still advancing, but nothing like the volume that were coming just a few minutes ago. Cease fire, Chris calls out. The ones closest to him hear and respond immediately, but the GPMG keeps going and the ones further down the line do not hear. Cease fire, Dave bellows. The firing stops immediately as they all turn to look at him. Keep the GPMG going and move round the Saxon to move down the road, Chris orders as they start regrouping. Curtis, you okay to keep driving, mate? Howie shouts over. Yes, Mr Howie, Curtis responds and clambers into the back and through to the driver's seat. They start grouping around the Saxon as Nick aims the fire into the last few groups of zombies struggling over the fallen and mashed up bodies on the road ahead of them. The GPMG falls silent after a short time as Nick calls out the all-clear. Move out! Stay close to the vehicle! Howie shouts, and the Saxon starts moving with the armed men and women standing shoulder to shoulder around the vehicle. They inch down, sacrificing speed for the ability to stay together as one unit. Contact! Someone shouts from the driver's side of the Saxon, and weapons fire as the zombies are cut down. To the rear! Jamie shouts, and more weapons open up as zombies continue to push out from the darkened buildings and run into the road towards the vehicle. Keep going, you're doing well, Chris shouts out, and slowly they move step by step down the road. The constant contacts keep them busy as they fire into zombies, pushing in from the sides and the rear, and then as they near the section where the truck was used to block the road, they start coming from the front. Nick, focus on the front. We need to keep our route clear, Howie shouts out. Nick spins around to face the road ahead, his face grim from the constant use of the machine gun. The recruits and guards shout out directions as they spot zombies flitting through the shadows. The contacts suddenly cease, and a silence descends, only broken by the low rumble of the heavy diesel engine of the armoured personnel carrier. Why have they stopped? Nick shouts out, spinning around to get a full view. I can't see him anywhere, he adds. They're still there, Jamie calls out. They're keeping pace with us in the shadows. Dave, can you see them? Howie asks. Yes, Dave replies. A small child walks slowly out from the shadows towards the passenger side of the Saxon. She wears a long white nightgown and her flowing blonde hair gleams in the moonlight. She shows no sign of injury. She stops just ahead of the vehicle and holds her arms out, offering an embrace. Come here, darling, one of the male guards shouts out and rushes forward. The girl looks normal and terrified as she holds her arms out and glances around behind her. Don't! Howie yells. The guard scoops the girl up and starts running back with her, but he screams as the girl sinks her teeth into his neck, savagely tearing the soft flesh apart with a violent gnashing. Her face is instantly soaked as the artery is opened and the hot red liquid spurts out. Two more guards rush forward. One of them grabs the girl and starts pulling her away. She wraps her arms round the first guard's head, clinging on as she devours the flesh with frenzied biting. A small horde of zombies then rush out from the shadows, taking advantage of the distance the guards have created between themselves and the Saxon. They are on the guards, instantly, pulling them to the floor and sinking teeth into the flesh. Screams erupt as more guards rush forward to beat them away. Stop! Chris shouts as they are set upon by more zombies surging out of the darkness. Cut them down! Dave booms out and opens up with his assault rifle, firing indiscriminately into the melee of fighting bodies. More guards scream out as they see their comrades being cut down by Dave. More zombies rush in, flying into the frenzied attack. Their screams rip the air apart. One of the guards lunges at Dave, desperately trying to stop him from shooting his own mates. Desperately trying to stop him from shooting down his mates. Blower steps in and pushes him away. 
The guard staggers but lashes out with his fist, knocking Blowers back. Cookie strides forward and slams the stock of his rifle into the guard's face, dropping him instantly. Clarence grabs the back of his collar and drags him around to the back of the vehicle and launches the unconscious form into the rear. Nick! Howie shouts out. Nick grimaces and slowly shakes his head as he aims down to the struggling mass of bodies. Some of the attacked guards are clearly still alive. Fuck it, Nick mutters and squeezes the trigger. The GPMG roars as it fires solid rounds into the mass of bodies, cutting them down instantly. Sobs sound out from the guards as the zombies and their friends are killed by the firing. Keep it together, Howie shouts. Stay with the vehicle. Shots sound out from the driver's side as the zombies show more intelligence by attacking that side with force while the resistors are focused on the passenger side. Nick spins around to see a mass of undead coming from the shadows at full pelt. He opens fire, trying to shout a warning at the same time. The zombies impact within seconds and more guards are taken down as their assault weapons become useless in the close quarters combat. The brawling bodies are right at the side of the vehicle and Nick pushes the machine gun over but can't get the angle to fire down. Dave runs around the back of the vehicle, throwing his assault rifle into the rear as he passes the open door, then draws his knives from the back of his waistband. Within short steps, he reaches the scrabbling line. The first guard is pinned against the side of the vehicle with zombies savaging her face. She screams and thrashes, but the body weight is too great. Dave steps behind them and draws a knife across each of their throats. Hot, infected blood bursts out into the female guard's face. Dave slips one of the knives between the gap between the zombie's bodies and pushes the sharp tip into her chest, pushing down until the blade cuts through her heart, killing her instantly. Dave twists the handle with a violent motion and pulls the blade out before spinning around to drive the two blades into the neck of a lunging undead female, then steps back as the zombie falls beside him. He works along the side of the still-moving Saxon, cutting down zombies and injured guards alike. At the last one, he spins through the air, slicing the throats open of the remaining zombies as his blade comes to rest millimetres away from the throat of the last guard. They keep walking sideways, keeping pace with the vehicle as the guard tries to push himself backwards into the solid metal side of the Saxon. Are you bitten? Dave roars into his face, terrifying him even more. No, no, they didn't get me, he stammers back. I am watching you. Dave says and promptly pulls away. This side is unguarded, he bellows out. Howie comes around the side from the front and looks back at the fallen bodies of the guards and zombies as the Saxon slowly advances down the narrow lane of the stacked vehicles. Fuck me, he mutters, taking in the now unguarded side of the vehicle, apart from Dave and one shaking guard who keeps glancing at Dave with a terrified expression. Are they all gone? Howie asks. Yes, Mr. Howie, Dave answers as he stalks next to the vehicle with his knives upturned against his forearms. Load up now, Howie shouts out as Chris appears from the rear of the vehicle. What the fuck? Chris's mouth drops open as he looks back at the fallen bodies. We need to load up and go, Howie shouts down, aware they will now fit in the vehicle as so many of the guards have been taken down. Chris nods back in silent agreement. They load up one by one covering each other as they work back down the side of the vehicle and into the rear doors of the moving Saxon. Howie is the last to load and pulls the doors closed. All in, he shouts. Catch up with the convoy, Curtis. Someone take over from Nick, give him a break, he adds, sinking down onto one of the side benches in exhaustion. The Saxon increases in speed as Curtis works to catch up with the fleet. The vastly reduced numbers are exhausted from the sustained battle. The remaining few guards weep and sob at the loss of their fallen friends. Howie looks up to Blowers and Cookie, both sitting forward with their heads down. Nick is slumped, leaning back with his eyes closed. Jamie and Dave are both sitting straight, eyes open and staring ahead out of the windscreen. Howie ticks them off in his mind as he goes, the mother hen counting the brood. Curtis driving, Tucker with the supply vehicle and Sarah in the back of the last vehicle. He looks over at Clarence, the big man taking up the space of two people with his enormous frame, leaning back with his eyes closed. Howie remembers him saving Sarah, and offers a silent prayer of thanks that he was in the position to react so quickly. Other than Dave, none of them would have been able to take so many down with their bare hands and walk away unscathed. 
Finally, he looks to Big Chris. They lock eyes. Two leaders who have suffered losses and taken the responsibility of so many lives and have fought to keep those people safe. One a former soldier and criminal, the other a supermarket manager. Something passes between them. A meeting of minds. An unspoken contract that they will do anything to ensure the survival of the people that have trusted them with their lives. Sarah stands with her head resting against the inside of the door. The last image as the doors were slammed was of Clarence staring hard at her at a scene of utter carnage behind him, and of Howie sprinting towards her, carrying two axes. She realises that she is holding something in her hand. The inside of the van is pitch black, and she feels around the object. It feels like a knife handle, but there is no blade. Her fingertips brush against a small button on the side. She looks back up to the door as she realises what he gave to her. She quickly tucks the item into her back pocket as she turns around. The motion of the vehicle and the gentle sway as it turns increases her sense of fear. Any notion of space and dimension disappear and she stretches her arms to press her hands against the insides of the vehicle. She feels the heat from the bodies pressed tightly into the back of the van and sweat starts to form on her face. Then she feels something small pressing into her and reaches down with a hand to feel a small head with long hair. Hey, it's okay, Sarah says softly as the small body flinches away from her hand. A tiny hand reaches up to touch hers, fingertips brushing gently, then gripping tightly. Mummy? A small voice says. No, I'm Sarah. Where is your mummy? She asks. I don't know, the child whimpers. Hey, everyone, there's a small child here missing her mummy. Sarah calls out to the darkness. Who is it? A female voice answers from somewhere near the front. What's your name, sweetie? Sarah asks the small child. Patricia, the small voice replies. Her name's Patricia, Sarah calls out. What's her mum's name? The same female, the same female voice answers. What's your mum's name, sweetie? Sarah asks. Jane. Her mother's called Jane, Sarah says. I don't know her. Does anyone else? The female voice calls out to no reply. What about your daddy? What's his name? Sarah asks Patricia. I don't know, Patricia whimpers, her voice small and weak. Come here, angel, Sarah says as she drops down low and draws the small girl into her body. The child throws her arms around Sarah's shoulders, squeezing tightly. I want to go home, Patricia says quietly. I know, sweetie, but we'll be okay. It won't be dark for long, Sarah replies, rubbing the girl's back. Is there light in here? The female voice from the front calls out. Sarah listens to the rustle of hands feeling alongside the sides and roof of the van, scrabbling about in the pitch dark. A feeble light switches on from the front. Hey, look over there, Sarah says softly. The girl turns slowly to see the very soft yellow light illuminating the many faces packed into the van, all of them women. A few of them smile down at the girl, hugging Sarah. See? We're not in the dark anymore and soon we'll be able to get out. We'll just have to wait, Sarah assures the girl. Will those things get us? Patricia asks with fear in her small voice. No, sweetie, they won't get us, Sarah says as Patricia pushes into her shoulder to cover her face. Do you promise? Patricia asks. I promise. I know the men looking after us and they're very, very brave. They won't let anything happen to us, Sarah says. Will they stop those things? Patricia asks. Yes, they will stop them and they will keep us all safe, I promise. They're big and strong and brave and we're in here and those things can't get us in here. How do you know them? One of the women asks. My brother is one of them. Sarah replies. One of the guards? Another asks. No, Howie is with the army vehicle. He's in charge of them. Sarah replies with pride. Howie! A woman screeches out from the far corner of the vehicle. Heads turn at the sudden noise as the voice screeches again. Howie! A commotion breaks out as another woman screams. She's biting her! She's one of them! A voice shouts out. Sarah catches a glimpse of an old woman sinking her teeth into the neck of a younger woman and blood pumping out. The packed bodies try to push away as others try to push in to stop the attack. 
Get her off, Sarah screams out as a hand reaches out to grasp the hair on the back of the head of the old woman, pulling her away with a violent yank. The attacked woman drops to the floor as women start pummeling into the freshly turned zombie and she goes down in the packed confines. The women screaming with fear. Feet start stamping down, desperately trying to kill the old woman. She got me! One of the women screams out as her ankle is bitten into. She drops down to beat her away until more boots and shoes can stamp down on the old woman's head and neck. Is she down? Sarah calls out. Yeah, where's the other one that she bit? Another voice shouts in panic. She's on the ground. She's not moving, someone answers. Kill her! She'll come back as one of them, the first voice shouts. In the dim light, Sarah makes out women pushing and scrabbling to get away from the fallen woman, some of the braver ones fighting to get to her, none of them able to move much because of the small space. The woman with the bitten ankle screams and sobs as she clutches her ankle. I've been bitten! I've been bitten! She repeats over and again. Sarah pulls the girl closer, her hands going around her chest in a protective embrace. Go behind me, sweetie, Sarah whispers in her ear and pushes the girl around. Another scream pierces the air as the savaged woman rises up and lunges with bloodshot eyes, sinking her teeth into the closest leg. Hands start beating at her as the van erupts in panic. The air is filled with screams and the van rocks from the pushing and pulling as the women fight to get away. More of them fall down from vicious bites as zombie teeth tear flesh apart. Women start slipping over as the wooden base of the van becomes slick with the spilled blood. More women are bitten and go down onto the ground. Sarah watches as the bodies fight and writhe on the ground. She slips her hand around and draws the handle from her back pocket, feeling for the small button. She holds it down at her side, with her finger pressed gently on the button. The driver of the van hears the screams and bangs clearly. His hands grip the steering wheel as pure terror grows inside him. He leans forward to stare at the red light of the vehicle in front. He knows he's the last in the fleet, and if he stops now, he'll be left behind, defenceless in the dark streets of London, surrounded by the undead. The bangs and screams increase as he drives, and hot tears start spilling down his face. He beats his hands against the steering wheel, imagining the scenes breaking out just inches behind him. Instinctively, He reaches for the radio and presses the on switch. Static fills the air. The driver finds a CD in the cubby hole of the dashboard and tries to force it into the CD slot, his hands shaking. The CD refuses to budge and it takes minutes for him to realise there is already a CD in the player. He throws the CD down onto the floor, frantically pressing buttons as the screams and bangs get louder from the rear. The driver finally presses the right button and loud rock music bursts out of the speakers. He twists the volume knob until the sound is so loud it comes out distorted. He looks up to see he has drifted off to the side in his panic to fill the van with noise. He overreacts and yanks the steering wheel hard. The van swerves over and then back again as he fights to get control. Sarah watches as the biggest bitch fight in the world breaks out in front of her. Then she lowers down to speak into the girl's ear. Put your hands over your eyes, sweetie, and keep them there. The girl does as she is asked and pushes her small hands over her tightly closed eyes. I'll be right back, I promise, Sarah whispers, while watching the unfolding mess in front of her. Half the women in the van are bitten, and the rest are fighting like troopers to protect themselves, falling and tripping over the bodies wrestling on the floor. An infected woman stumbles backwards, having been thrust by a large-built woman at the front. The zombie stumbles into Sarah, who reaches around to grip her around the neck, squeezing tightly. She presses the small button on the handle, a shiny blade sliding out instantly, and Sarah digs this into the throat of the woman while gripping hard. Blood pumps out, covering her hand and arm. She pushes the body away, just as the large woman sends another one her way. Sarah steps forward and grabs the zombie, pulling her head forward as she sticks the knife deep into her throat, then twists the handle left to right and back again, tearing a ragged hole in her windpipe. Loud rock music booms out from the front, drowning out the screams, grunts and groans of the women trying to kill each other. Sarah drops the woman down and lunges for the next one as the van swerves violently, causing all the women to fly onto one side, landing in a crumpled heap with Sarah at the bottom of the pile.
Pinned to the floor by bloodied bodies, she thrashes her legs, frantically trying to prevent any of the undead from biting her ankles. The bodies fight and writhe about as Sarah struggles for breath under the heavy weight. The van swerves again as the bodies slide across the slick floor to ram into the other side. Sarah is now free and rises up to see red bloodshot eyes pushing towards her. She yells as she sticks the blade into the throat, missing and stabbing the woman through the cheek instead. She pulls the small handle back and lashes out again and again, swiping the blade back and forth across the throat. Another one pushes her head out of the mess of limbs and Sarah rams her foot into the face, feeling bones crunch underfoot. She tries to roll away as the van swerves again and they slide back across the floor to pin Sarah against the side. Once more trapped under the bodies, she fights to draw her legs into the fetal position, hoping the press of bodies will protect her. She feels the blade sinking into the back of another woman pressing into her, with no idea if she's stabbing a zombie or another survivor. She tries to pull the knife away, but her arm is pinned into position as the body writhes on the blade. Another swerve sends them back across the floor, and Sarah loses grip on the knife as they slam into the other side. She crabs backwards as a body drops down on her, blood pouring from a deep bite wound to her neck. Sarah cranes her neck, trying to keep her face away from the blood, and she rolls hard to displace the body, pushing it aside as she gets back to her feet. Another zombie comes from the right and Sarah quickly ducks down and moves behind to wrap her arms around her neck. Sarah squeezes with all her might as the body staggers forward, arms flailing. A woman in front of them turns around to bite into the mass of bodies and Sarah sees the knife sticking out of her back. She reaches out to grab the handle as the zombie pulls away. Sarah squeezes hard and pulls her upper body backwards, forcing the zombie to fall down. Sarah slams her booted feet down again and again on the face, just as the one with the knife stuck in her turns to Sarah with bloodied teeth bared. Sarah slams her fist into the side of its face, snapping the head away, then sidesteps and finally gets a grip on the knife. She pulls it out and forces the blade into the side of the zombie's neck, sawing and hacking away until a large, ragged hole forms in the soft flesh. She turns to see an undead lunge at Patricia, still cowering in the corner with her hands over her eyes. Sarah dives forward onto the floor and grabs the ankles, pulling them back as hard as she can. The zombie slams down face forward onto the floor as Sarah clambers over its back to grab the head and slam it down again and again onto the hard flooring. Remembering the knife in her hand, she repeatedly stabs into the ribcage, breaking bones and puncturing the lungs. The body eventually goes still, as Sarah rolls off to find another one bearing down on her. She lifts her feet up and takes the weight of the zombie body on its chest. Her boots push into the zombie's breasts as she tries to force it away. The zombie is heavy, fighting forward, and Sarah feels her legs starting to buckle. She rolls to the side as the body falls down, just missing her. She slams her arm down and forces the blade into the back of the neck before the zombie can roll or turn towards her. Sarah keeps fighting and knifing the zombies down as they are bitten and turned one by one. She fights out with desperation until she is side by side with the large built woman from earlier. The large woman wraps her arms around a zombie, pinning her against the side of the van. Stab her! The woman yells as Sarah lunges forward with the knife to slice open the undead's throat. They back away as the body slides down onto the already crowded floor. The large woman thrusts her arm out to grab the hair of a zombie about to bite Sarah from the other side, yelling a warning as she fights to pull the undead woman away. Sarah sticks the small blade deep into the exposed neck. They keep going until the last one drops down onto the top of the gory pile of corpses, both of them soaked with blood and filth. They back away until they're both standing protectively in front of Patricia. Sarah hands the other woman the knife and drops down so she is eye-level with the little girl. Sweetie, I want you to turn round and face the other way now. Can I take my hands away? Patricia answers. Yes, but only when you've turned round. Did those things get in here? Patricia asked. You promised they wouldn't. Sarah looks up to exchange a glance with the other woman. Just turn for me, Patricia. There's none of them in here now. It's safe, Sarah says, as she turns the girl around. I'm Mary, 
the large-built woman says when Sarah stands up. Nice to meet you. Do you want your knife back? Yes, if you don't mind, Sarah replies. Nice to meet you too, Mary. You're better with it than me. I'll grab him and you stab him, the large woman jokes. Deal, Sarah replies, as they stare down at the bodies piled in front of them. There they are, Curtis says to Howie, who is now in the passenger seat. Nice one, mate. Just need to get to the front now, Howie replies. The tail lights disappear around a bend in the road, but soon come into view again as the Saxon speeds up. Curtis drives up close behind the last van, the one containing Sarah, Mary, Patricia and the pile of zombie bodies. They flash headlights to alert the driver they are going around as Curtis pulls out to start overtaking them. One by one, they drive past the fleet of vehicles, Howie giving a wave or a thumbs up to the drivers while wondering how they will feel when they find out most of their guards have been wiped out. Which fort are we heading for? Chris calls out from the back. There's quite a few of them, but I reckon we should go for Fort Spitbank. It's the biggest one that I know of and it's been maintained, Howie shouts back. Have you been there before? Chris asks. Yeah, but years ago. We went with the school and then a couple of times later. It's huge and the rear wall goes straight onto the sea. From memory, it had open flat land all around it too. Let's just hope it's not full then, Chris says. The Saxon weaves its way past the fleet of vans, cars and trucks until it eventually reaches the front. A long convoy snaking out of London into the pitch black of the countryside. Howie checks and rechecks the map, planning ahead and making sure they stick to major roads so the big trucks can fit through. Malcolm to Chris. We're being flashed by headlights from behind. There must be an issue. Can we find a safe area to pull up? Chris to Malcolm and all units. Roger that. I know this road. There is a section ahead with high concrete walls on both sides. We will stop there. About a mile or so further, Howie, you'll see big walls on both sides. We want to stop there, Chris shouts forward. Got it, mate. Curtis, make sure you keep to the middle lane so we have equal distance on both sides, Howie says. OK, Mr Howie. Within a few minutes, the Saxon is slowing down as they enter into a very long, straight section of the motorway. High concrete walls create a tunnel effect from the headlights and the dark sky. Who's on the GPMG? Howie asks. Jamie, Blowers answers. Right, I want us out, down the sides, keeping watch. And Curtis, I want you to drive forward a short distance so you, Jamie, can get a good view of the sides. Everyone ready? Good. Everyone out then, Howie shouts as he jumps down and runs back to meet Chris. They stride down the left flank of the convoy, pausing as Malcolm jumps out from the front vehicle to meet them. What's up? Chris asks him. I don't know, we were getting constant flashes from behind, Malcolm replies. They walk to the next vehicle and shout up to the driver. He leans out of the open window with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. Everything all right? Howie calls up. We're fine, we were getting flashed from behind, so I passed it on. They walk to the next vehicle to find Tucker climbing down from the passenger door and stretching out. That looked a bit nasty back there, Mr Howie, Tucker says. It was, mate. Was it you flashing? Nope. Came from behind, Tucker replies. They walk down the fleet of vehicles, with each driver giving the same response. With only a few vehicles left in the fleet, Howie looks back to see the driver of the last vehicle running towards them, waving his arms in the air. That's Sarah's vehicle, Howie yells, as he starts running forward, Big Chris and Dave sprinting beside him. They were screaming and banging, I didn't know what to do, I didn't want to get left behind, the driver sobs as they run past him. Howie twists around the back of the van and wrenches the rear doors open to see Sarah standing facing him, covered in blood. A small knife is held tightly in her right hand. Her left hand grips the fingers of a small girl who is also holding hands with a large-built woman. The three of them drip with blood and gore. Sarah! What the fuck? Howie stammers as he jolts forward, picking the girl up to pass back to Chris. As Sarah and Mary step down, Howie's mouth drops open as he looks at the scene of utter carnage in the back of the van. Dead bodies are strewn about and piled up, thick pools of blood shimmering on the floor and smeared up the sides. Dead eyes, both human and zombie, stare blankly. Dead mouths gape accusingly at him. 
What happened? Howie says to the women. One of them turned and it just sort of exploded from there, Sarah replies calmly. This is Mary. Mary, this is my brother, Howie. Howie stands speechless as Mary calmly says hello. Dave then steps forward to peer into the back of the van. He gazes at Mary and Sarah, then down at the small knife, then finally back to the bodies. He looks at Howie and nods, clearly impressed at the work completed. Who's the girl? Howie eventually asks when his brain catches up with the sight before him. Patricia, she lost her mum, Sarah replies, still in a calm voice. Mary steps forward to take the child from Chris, who is also standing with his mouth hanging open. We'll come with you, Sarah says flatly. We don't have a lot of room, Chris starts to say. She said we're coming with you, Mary glares at Chris. Yep, fine, no problem, Chris replies quickly, holding his hands up. The vehicles move off again, the Saxon in the lead, with Sarah and Mary sitting in the hastily vacated seats, using wet wipes to clean themselves and Patricia of the blood and filth. Hardened and battle-experienced men watch them with keen interest. They work with purpose, chatting with the small child as though nothing had happened. Before the women arrived, Chris had got to the vehicle ahead of them and quickly whispered what they had seen inside the van. Clarence had moved quickly to Sarah on seeing the state she was in, asking her again and again if she was okay. You can have your knife back now, she offered, as the huge man fussed around her. No, you keep it, in fact, Clarence said as he unbuckled his belt and removed one of the large sheath knives from it before handing it to Sarah. You'd better have a bigger one. How'd it go on, Sarah said, taking the big knife and pulling it from the sheath to admire the weapon. Here, let me, Clarence said as he unbuckled Sarah's belt and pulled it free from the loops. Then, suddenly realising what he was doing, he looked down to see her smiling at him. Oh, uh, sorry, I I didn't mean to, he blushed bright red to Sarah's delight. What didn't you mean to do, she asked mischievously. "Uh, Undo your belt, he stammered. But you did undo my belt, she replied. Yeah, but, you you know. I know what? I, uh, well, uh, I didn't mean it like that. Like what, she asked innocently and laughed as he went even redder. I'm only joking. Thank you for the knife, she said, touching him on his massive forearm as his face split apart with a huge grin. Howie had taken over the driving, seeing Curtis looking tired and drawn and suggested he get some rest in the back. Did you see those bodies? Howie asked Dave as they continued driving. Yes, Mr Howie, I was there, Dave replies. Oh, no, not this again. I meant, did you see how many were there? Yes, I was there. Do you do this on purpose? Do what? Answer each question literally. How do I answer that? What? You ask me if I answer each question literally, so in order to give you an answer, I would have to be literal, which would then suggest that I do, in fact, answer each question literally. You never cease to amaze me, Dave. Thanks, Mr Howie. The crowded Saxon settles into near silence as they travel towards the coast. The exhausted survivors try to sleep in whatever space they can find. Patricia dozes fitfully, snuggled into Mary in one rear corner while Sarah rests in the other. The others find space where they can. Clarence and Chris both remain standing near the front, leaning in towards Howie and Dave and chatting in muted tones. Have you seen any yet? Chris asks. Nope. Not one. Fuck knows where they've all gone, Howie replies. Can't be a good thing, Chris says. Darren knew all along we would be heading for the forts, but I don't think I ever said which one, Howie says. So there's no doubt that they're going to be coming for us then, Chris says. It just depends how long it takes him, and we haven't seen any for a long time, so I reckon they're massing again, Howie says. We're waiting for him to pass through so they can join in, Chris says. Jesus, there'll be thousands of them if he collects them all on the way, says Clarence. More than that, Chris says. I was wondering if he would try to use vehicles. He's obviously got control over the rest of them somehow, Howie says. Yeah, and if he can tap into their memories and knowledge, then it wouldn't be hard to get the keys for the vehicles and move down here quickly, Chris interrupts. He'll come on foot, Dave says in his normal flat tone. 
How do you know? Howie asks. They've been going for a week now with no sign of slowing down. They're decaying but still moving. I haven't seen any of them eat or drink, so they don't need sustenance, which also means time is not relevant to them. He held them outside the commune until he thought there were sufficient numbers, but he held himself back away from harm, which shows he has awareness for his own safety. They also massed in Canary Wharf when we went for your sister, so the biggest single tactic deployed by them is high numbers. Logistics for any army on the move is difficult at the best of times and will be even harder using vehicles. Not if they have collective intelligence, Howie cuts in, and it does look like they have. Darren snapped his fingers and they all started laughing. Then he made them take a step forward perfectly in time. With that kind of power and control, they could find it easy. I don't think they will, Dave replies. That would mean having every one of them have access to a vehicle and be ready in the right place at the right time to slip in with the main fleet. Even if they share intelligence, that is an extremely hard thing to organise. A forced march is the best way for them to pick them up as they go. So if they have a collective intelligence or consciousness, then they would know the route they're taking and would just have to wait at those points, Chris says. Yes, Dave responds. So why not get vehicles and wait at those points, Howie asks. Their motor skills have got better, but during the day they shuffle and become slow and are not able to control their own bodies that well. We saw them increase speed during the day, but that made them weaker. Darren will have no choice but to keep them moving at a set pace that can cover ground but will conserve energy to prevent them weakening, Dave explains clearly. OK, so how long will it take to walk that distance? Howie asks. They can go as the crow flies in a straight line, so that would be about 50 miles or so, Clarence says. If they shuffle along like they do during the day, then a couple of days at least. If they move fast the entire time, it could be as little as 16 to 20 hours but we know that weakens them. But if they have enough... Uh, people, I guess then they might not worry about being weaker, says Chris. People, Howie laughs. Yeah, I know, I don't like the other word there, Chris replies. What, zombies? Howie asks. Yeah, it seems like a movie or something when I use that word, laughs Chris. What do you think, Dave? Howie asks. About the word zombies? It doesn't bother me. No, Howie laughs again, about the speed they'll move at. Oh, sorry, I don't think time is an issue for them, so they will do what all big organisations do. Which is? Clarence asks after a lengthy pause. They will work out the best speed to make the best distance using the least amount of fuel, like airlines do, or shipping companies, Dave replies. Sounds ridiculous when you say it like that, Howie says, but I guess that's about right, though. Well, we have no answer to the question then. We don't know when they'll turn up, says Chris. In short, nope, Howie replies. Brilliant. We have a huge army of dead people marching through the country specifically looking for us, and we're heading for a 150-year-old fort somewhere on the coast with a handful of men able to fight. I like those odds, Chris laughs. Stuff em, Clarence says in his deep voice. Stuff him? What kind of an insult is that? Chris laughs, looking at the huge man mountain. Well, there are ladies and a child present, and I don't want to be a potty mouth. The deep voice rumbles as the rest burst out laughing. Potty mouth? That's even worse, Howie says, laughing. I just watched you take four of them down with your bare hands. Yeah, well, there's no need for foul language in the presence of ladies, Clarence replies defensively. I think your sister has an admirer, Howie. Chris says, wiping tears of laughter from his eyes. No, just hang on, Clarence tries to interrupt, going red in the face. Oh, really? You fancy my sister, do you? Howie asks, pretending to be offended. No one said anything about me fancying your sister, Mr Howie, Clarence says. Oh, he's Mr Howie now, is he? Trying to win him over, are you? Chris laughs again as Howie bends forward, trying to stop laughing so loud. No, he is Mr Howie. Everyone calls him that, Clarence says in a more defensive tone. So, you don't fancy Sarah then, Chris asks, unable to stop goading him. No, of course I don't, Clarence replies, going even redder. Where's your knife then, Chris asks innocently. My what? Clarence replies, his voice going higher as Howie starts to laugh harder. 
Your knife. I gave you that knife years ago after you broke that cheap thing you had. Well, she only had the little knife. That little knife that you gave her, and now you've given her your big knife. What's next, the axe? Chris says between laughing. Oh, just fuck off. Clarence finally snaps, his voice louder. Language, please. There's a child back here. Keep that potty mouth for later, Mary calls out as Howie and Chris burst out laughing even more. Even Dave chuckles as Clarence drops his head into his hands, groaning. What's so funny? Sarah asks, clambering over the legs of sleeping forms to get to the front. We were just talking about Clarence, Chris replies, still chuckling. Oh, what about? Sarah asks, stretching. Chris? Clarence growls, his face bright red, and tries to turn away from Sarah. Just about the knife he gave you, how he cuts in. Tears streaming down his face. Oh, that was sweet. Thank you again, Clarence. You'll have to show me how to use it, though. It's very big, Sarah replies, smiling at him. Howie, are you all right? She asks, as Howie's body heaves with laughing, bent forward enough to be almost biting the steering wheel. Fine. I'm fine, Howie whimpers. Clarence was just saying how he wants to show you some moves, Chris says innocently. That's great. Thank you, Clarence, Sarah says, placing her hand on his shoulder. It's no problem. Clarence replies. Are you okay? Your face is very red, Sarah says with concern. You coming down with something? She presses the back of her hand to his forehead. No, no, I'm just very hot in here, Clarence replies very softly. Okay, well, I'll leave you boys to it and try to get some more rest, Sarah says as she clambers back down the Saxon. Okay, we'll be quieter now, Sarah, Chris smiles as she goes then looks down at Clarence, bent over, resting his head on the back of the seat, his face now beetroot-coloured, but his forehead tingling from where she touched him. Poor Clarence, are you OK? Chris says in a sweet voice, and puts his hand on Clarence's face. Fuck off, you wanker, Clarence whispers. Oh, poor Clarence, come here, you big teddy bear, and give me a cuddly wuddly, Chris laughs as he tries to wrap his arms round Clarence's huge shoulders. I said, fuck off, Chris, Clarence whispers as he starts laughing, trying to squirm out of the manly embrace. So, how do you feel, Howie, about Clarence showing your sister some moves with the knife? Chris asks. Me? I'm fine with it, mate. You carry on, Howie replies, still chuckling. Really? Clarence looks over at him as Chris laughs again. You don't mind, then? No, mate, but Dave's the one with the knife skills. Maybe he should do it, Howie says. What do you think, Dave? I think your sister would like Clarence to do it, Dave replies, showing a rare ability to pick up on a social situation. Cheers, Dave, Clarence says softly. From the motorway, the convoy takes a slip off to pass quickly through rural villages as the night sky starts to lift. The lush landscape of rolling hills, wooded copses and cultivated fields soon becomes flat, open heathland, the first signs they are nearing the coast. The Saxon leads the vehicles through an industrial zone with large, hangar-style buildings, signed for marine engineering. Expensive-looking powerboats and luxurious yachts loom high on giant stands dotted about the area. This is the road into the fort, Howie reports back to the rest. As far as I can remember... This is the only road in. The convoy drives through the industrial units and into a country lane bordered with high hedges. Within a few minutes, they enter a housing estate full of large, detached houses. The road passes through the middle of the estate, which abruptly ends with lines of dwellings stretching out on both sides, bordering open heathland. Howie explains that the landscape changed abruptly 150 years ago when the fort was constructed to allow the defenders a wide view of the entire area. Thickets of trees and undulating hillocks had been flattened and now the area remains wide open. Lights shining in the distance are the only sign of the fort ahead of them. Can you slow down please Mr Howie? Dave asks quickly. Did you see something? Howie replies as he slows the vehicle down, causing a long line of red brake lights to shine out behind him. Dave looks to the rows of buildings stretched out on both sides, then out to the flat land, the sky getting lighter with each passing minute. Is the fort down there where the lights are? Dave asks, pointing down the road, away from the estate. Yep, you can see it clearly during the day, Howie replies. OK, thanks, Mr Howie, Dave says, apparently satisfied. 
Chris, can you hear me? Howie calls out. Chris lumbers back to the front and leans forward. What's up? He asks. Chris, when we get there, we need to make sure we are isolated if we discuss anything. Howie whispers just loud enough for Chris and Dave to hear. We don't know how long Darren was infected before he turned, and we don't know anything about the people here, Howie adds, as they both nod, understanding. How do we know none of us are infected? Dave asks. Well, I know I'm not, Howie replies quickly. Darren would have said that too, Dave says. True. So how can we be sure, Howie asks. Check for bites and scratches. Any open wounds? Chris says quietly. How about we get Doc Roberts to check us over to be sure, Howie suggests. Sounds good. I'm okay with that, Chris replies. Dave, that all right with you? Howie whispers. Yes, Mr. Howie, Dave nods. They drive forward on the straight road as night transforms to morning. The rain clouds of the previous day have now drifted away, leaving a beautifully clear sky. The flat grassland suddenly rises into steep embankments that stretch out to both sides, with the road cutting through the middle of them. Once past the grass banks, they see another stretch of flat grassland, then another high, steep embankment which drops down into a wide ditch on the reverse side. The ditch is cut deep into the earth and is at least ten feet in width, with sheer sides. So we've got the first high bank flat land, then another high bank dropping down into a deep ditch, then more flat land. Chris voices his thoughts out loud as he takes the scene in. It looks like the banks stretch out to both sides of the spit. So does the ditch. Is that an outer wall or just the main wall? He asks Howie. Uh, I think it's an outer wall, Howie replies, trying to remember. From memory, the rear of the fort has a high wall that drops down straight into the sea. The land was dug out, so the sea is very deep straight away with no beach. I think there's a rear access point, though, he explains. The rear wall runs the length of the rear section and then curves back round with the natural lay of the spit. The front section here isn't a straight wall. It has two sections that jut out, one on each side where the wall starts coming back inland. And then there's the long straight bit we can see here, how he finishes. We'll need a good look around as soon as possible, Dave says. Ah, you mean we need an advanced recce reconnaissance pathfinder, Howie jokes. Dave smiles back at him, remembering the previous conversation of a few days ago. Hello, we've got company. Chris points up to the high walls to see heads moving about, peeking over and then dropping back down. Howie brings the Saxon to a halt a few metres back from the gates. I'll go and say hello he says, opening the door and dropping down to stretch his arms out and arch his back. Ah, that feels nice, he mutters. Dave jumps down and walks around to join him at the front. Well, we made it, mate, Howie says as they walk towards the gates. We did, Mr Howie, and we got your sister, Dave replies. It's all good in the hood, mate, apart from the zombie army coming to eat us. They stop a few feet back from the gates, looking at a single door cut into the solid metal plates. A small hatch opens from the inside, and a pinched face looks out. Are you bitten? A high-pitched female voice calls out. Oh yes, we are bitten all over and completely infected, Howie smiles broadly. I'd recognise that voice anywhere. Hello, Debbie. You'll have to strip off again, the voice laughs back from the hatch. Now, stop being a pervert and trying to look at Dave being naked and let us in. We're gasping for a brew, Howie says, laughing. The single door swings inwards, and Sergeant Debbie Hopwell walks out, looking neat and tidy and still wearing her all-black police uniform. Hello, Mr Howie, Debbie smiles as she reaches them, genuine pleasure on her face. They hug briefly. It's good to see you, Debbie. I somehow knew you'd be at the front gate, Howie says. Well, we can't just have anyone at the main entry point, now can we? Debbie says, turning to Dave and giving him an awkward hug, which makes him blush bright red. Let me guess. You had a meeting and got it submitted in triplicate and posted on the rotor on some wall somewhere, Howie jokes. Oh yes, there must be order, Howie. Debbie smiles back. Hello, hello. There's a couple of ugly faces I wouldn't forget in a hurry. A loud voice booms out into the quiet morning air. 
Ted, hello, mate. It's good to see you, Harry calls out as he steps forward to shake hands with the former policeman. You too, Mr. Howie. Hello, Dave. You've kept him alive, then, Ted says, looking at Dave but nodding towards Howie. Hello, Ted. Dave leans forward to shake his hand but stops midway. Did you wash your hands this time? He jokes. Bloody hell, someone's taught him a sense of humour, Ted says as they shake hands. So, you made it down here okay then? Howie asks them both. Easy run, really. We just kept going, despite young Tom whining that he needed to pee, Ted replies. You should have seen the state of the place, though, Debbie cuts in. Absolute bedlam. People arriving every few minutes. There was no order, no rationing, no lists, nothing. It's taken days to get things shipshape, she adds. Well... We've got a couple of thousand tired, scared, hungry and thirsty people crammed into these vehicles, Howie says, turning back to look at the vehicles and seeing Chris, Clarence and Sarah walking towards them. We'd better get them inside then. They'll have to come in on foot. We don't have the room for the vehicles, Debbie responds in a business-like fashion. Ted, Debbie, this is Chris, Clarence and my sister, Sarah. Chris had set up a safe area in London, but it got overrun last night as we left. How he introduces them as they shake hands with polite greetings. Right, we need to get the people out and filing in here, Howie says. No room for the vehicles, though. Have you set up a vehicle area? He asks. Not inside. I made them take the vehicles out and put them into the estate, Debbie replies. We've kept a few for patrolling and gathering supplies, though, she adds. OK, how do you want this done? Howie asks. We're recording the names, date of birth and last address of everyone entering and then allocating them a specific place inside the compound. We also record any specific skills such as butchery or carpentry, that kind of thing, Debbie replies. We've got doctors, nurses and some hospital equipment with us, Chris adds. Brilliant. We're desperate for medical personnel. Right, I suggest you get them out of the vehicles and line up in front of the gates. I'll get some people out to distribute water while they wait, Debbie says. They depart from the brief meeting, as Debbie and Ted head back inside to prepare for the incoming refugees. Howie and his small group walk back into the Saxon, and Howie calls the recruits and guards over. Chris calls out on the radio for all guards to make their way to the front. Within a few minutes, the small force are all assembled in front of Howie and Chris. Dr Roberts and a few of the medical team stand to one side. Right, they've got enough room for everyone but we have to line them up for details to be taken. We need a perimeter set up, and Curtis, I want you to take the Saxon and go to the rear. Keep sweeping back and forth across that area. Nick, I want you on the GPMG. Blowers and Cookie, you're both at the gates being nice to people again. Sarah, would you mind going with them? Howie asks. No problem. I'll take Mary with me, Sarah replies. Be on the lookout for anyone with cuts, bites, or any open wounds, Howie continues. What if we see any? A voice asks. They need to be isolated, but do it quietly with no fuss and do not create panic, Chris cuts in. Doc, can you set something up inside to check people over as they enter? Yes, Doc Roberts replies curtly and moves off with his team. Jamie, I want you up high somewhere with the sniper rifle, Howie says to the quiet lad as Jamie looks about. Go in and get up on the inside of the outer wall, Dave says to him. Right. Spread out, stay sharp, and get those people out, Howie calls out as they depart. Jamie runs back to the Saxon and draws the sniper rifle from the protective bag. He loops the bag over his shoulder and starts jogging towards the gate. Tucker, we'll get that supplies vehicle up front for unloading. Can you get inside and see what the situation with supplies is like? I would imagine Sergeant Hopewell would have a tight grip on it, Howie asks him. OK, Mr Howie, I'm on it now. Tucker replies, and starts striding after Jamie to the gate. Doc Roberts and his team walk past, carrying armfuls of equipment and soon disappear into the gate too. Mr Howie! a voice calls out. Howie turns to see Tom Jenkins and Stephen Taylor walking towards him, both of them with huge smiles. Hello Tom, hi Stephen, good to see you lads again. Howie smiles as they shake hands with genuine warmth. I knew you'd make it. Tom says excitedly, looking back at the armed guards. Wow, you got more soldiers with you. Are they SF too? Uh, 
No, some of them are ex-soldiers, police officers like you, and some army recruits we sort of found, Howie says. Wow, and you're in charge of them all. Tom looks at Howie with awe. Well, I wouldn't say that, Howie starts. Yes, Mr Howie is in charge with that man over there, Dave says flatly, pointing at Big Chris. The vehicles are slowly unloaded. Scared and terrified survivors drop down from the trucks and squint in the bright sunlight, or slowly emerge from cars to stretch wearily. Howie watches as Sarah and Clarence work their way back along the fleet, telling the people to move down to the gates where Blowers and Cookie are standing, smiling and joking with their assault rifles strapped to their shoulders. Howie, Chris and Dave stand near the front, watching the Saxon drive off with Nick waving at them from the top, smiling as they go back down to the rear. They're good lads, those recruits, Chris says. Very good, considering what they've been through, Howie replies. Bloody brave, too. We need to start thinking about defence, Chris says, turning to look at Howie. No time like the present, then, Howie replies, as they make their way over and finally step through into Fort Spitbank. They step into the shadow of the gate and pause for a few seconds to allow their eyes to adjust. The outer wall behind them stretches off in both directions, with a gap wide enough for a few vehicles to drive abreast before the inner wall looms up. Bloody big wall, Chris mutters. Good job, really. We should just close the door and hide, Howie replies, to see Chris smiling back at him. Well, we could, but where would be the fun in that, says Chris. Hello, gentlemen, a voice calls out from behind them. They turn to see an old man walking towards them, wearing a blue jumper marked with the English Heritage Badge. A cravat is tucked into the front of the V-neck jumper, grey roots show in his thinning, dyed ginger hair. Hi, Howie responds as the man draws closer. They shake hands, and Howie watches as the man turns to Chris and Dave in turn, Dave quickly wiping his hand immediately after the shaking. So, which one of you is Mr Howie? the man asks, looking at them each in turn. Uh, that'll be me, Howie says. Name's Hastings, Roger Hastings, as in the famous battle, the man smiles at Howie. Oh, uh, nice to meet you, Mr Hastings, Howie replies. Oh, now call me Roger, the man beams back at him. How did you know my name? Howie asks. There's been some talk of you in here, quite some talk of Mr Howie and Dave rampaging around the country, killing off the heathen undead. Roger talks quickly with an effeminate voice. Oh, uh, really? Well, Howie stutters, unsure of how to respond. I think there's quite a few of the people you've met already in here. I keep hearing stories of the famous Mr Howie and Dave, and here you are in the flesh. Roger speaks, waving his hand as he talks. Now, Roger, they've only just arrived, so take it easy with them, Ted calls out, walking over to them. Howie, this is Roger Hastings. He was the principal guide here for the guided tours. Apparently he's been here since the place was first built, Ted adds, smiling at Howie. Oh, stop it, Ted, you big brute, Roger simpers, smacking a limp hand on Ted's old but still solid shoulder. Excuse me for interrupting, but your doctor has set up an initial screening room just off to the right inside the inner wall. The people are getting processed fairly quickly and we should have them all inside quite soon. Debbie's got a few of her team getting details as they come through, Ted says. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate the update. How many people are already here? Howie asks. You'll have to ask Debbie for the official figures, but with your lot coming in, I'd say that puts us up to maybe 7,000? Ted replies. 7,000? In here? Bloody hell, Howie exclaims, looking at Chris, who looks equally stunned. Word spread quickly. People met up on roads and told each other about it, and, well, they just kept coming. It slowed right down yesterday and the day before, but obviously now we've got a lot more coming in. Ted shrugs his shoulders. Listen, I need to get back and help Debbie before young Tom and Stephen drive her mad. I'll leave you in the capable hands of Roger for the full experience. Ted winks at them as he turns away. Thanks, Ted, Howie calls out. Ted waves back at them. Are you ready? Roger asks, hand on hip and head cocked to one side. Howie glances at Chris, and then looks to Dave, who is staring wide-eyed at Roger. Uh, yeah, I guess so, Howie says. Okay, boys, follow me, please, Roger says as he starts to walk towards the inner wall. They follow behind, exchanging glances and shrugging shoulders. 
Stepping away from the gated section of the outer wall, they walk through a large gap in the inner wall and enter the fort proper. The sight that greets them is staggering, and they stop to take in the view. Ahead of them lies the interior of the fort, open land with the thick inner wall running around the entire perimeter. The wide open grassed area of the fort is thick with tents and marquees. Some wooden structures have been hastily erected amongst them. Tents of all sizes and shapes have been placed into the grounds. At first, it looks to be a mess of canvas and modern tents, but Howie quickly realises there has been order in the layout. Right, gents? Roger drops the effeminate speech as he launches into full tour guide mode. Initially, we were using the buildings built into the fort walls. As you can see, there are doors and gated entrances built into the inner wall. Within those doors and gated entrances are many rooms and tunnels. They were originally designed for ammunition storage, food and supplies, also barracks, sergeants and officers' quarters. There were hundreds of soldiers based here. They had to live and work within the fort, so everything they needed was within these walls. There is even a fresh water well here. Does it still work? Chris cuts in quickly. Oh yes, we've been using it constantly. They knew what they were doing back in those days. The site was very carefully chosen. They would have needed fresh water in the event of a siege, which they fully expected, Roger continued. Anyway, we were using the buildings and rooms within the fort walls as accommodation until we started getting more and more people arriving. Some of those people were surveyors and architects, so we were able to start designating the grounds to be used. We have sectioned off small areas to the best of our ability, so we can keep walkways and avenues running between them. It looks impressive, Howie comments. It took some doing, but Sergeant Hopwell was very good at getting the right people into the right roles. We were cooking from a central point, but as the population grew, we had to separate that into several smaller cooking points. Each personal group that arrives only gets entry on the basis that they hand over their supplies, to make sure the distribution is fair. Has anyone refused? Howie asks. A few got upset, which is understandable, but we were able to convince them to leave the supplies outside and step in to see it was a good setup and they were not going to be robbed. Most of them are just glad to get somewhere safe. I can imagine. So have you got many supplies, then? A population this size will need a lot of food, Howie says. Well, as soon as we got some organisation in here, we started sending out armed foraging patrols. They were tasked to gather supplies and avoid contact at all costs. They've been bringing back tents, sleeping bags, wet weather clothing, bedding, food, medicine, and anything that will help us. They've been raiding every outdoor and camping shop for miles. In terms of food, we are okay, not brilliant, but with careful rationing, we've been able to make sure everyone at least gets something, Roger explains as they walk into the grounds and stroll down the wide central path. People scurry about or sit looking forlorn outside of tents. They all stare at Dave, Howie and Chris as they walk through, and Dave picks up on some nudges and whispers. Are the fort buildings in use now? Chris asks. Sergeant Hopewell uses one as admin offices, and there is a larger section of rooms built into the south side that have been taken over as a hospital. The rooms are the biggest, cleanest, and most recently repaired. In fact, most of the rooms and sections built into the south side are being used. We have the supplies section in there and the armory. The armory? Dave asks immediately upon hearing his favourite word. Yes, we have sourced some items, shotguns, rifles, and quite a lot of ammunition. It's where we stored the black powder for special events, Roger explains. Black powder? Dave asks again. The fort has retained some of the original cannon and armaments, which one of the historical societies still use for events and public displays. How much black powder do you have? Dave asks, staring hard at Roger. Quite a lot, Roger replies. After a brief pause while Dave soaks in that information, Roger continues. So, that's the south side. Over towards the east section, we have the visitor's centre, gift shop and cafe. We're using that as a meeting place and information point. This is great, Roger. Really very good and well organised, Howie says, genuinely impressed. We're not even at the start yet, Roger replies immediately back in his camp voice as they enter the visitor's centre. There is a quiet calm inside the building, and Howie recognises the young lady sitting behind the reception desk, speaking to a few people. Hello, Terry, Howie calls out to the female police officer that he met in the police station. 
Mr. Howie, wow, I heard you arrived. Terry smiles sweetly, rushing around the desk and running to hug Howie. Howie responds, slightly embarrassed, as the pretty blonde girl squeezes him tightly. Uh, so, how have you been? Howie asks, unsure of what to say after the display of affection. He thought of Terry Trixie as stuck up and prudish when they'd first met. Well, apart from Tom and Stephen being a pain in the ass, we've been very well. Terry smiles back at him, finally releasing him from the hug. Hello, Dave. Lovely to see you too. Terry turns on Dave, stepping forward to embrace him. Howie holds his laugh in at the look of pure terror on Dave's face as he squirms uncomfortably. Terry, this is Chris, Howie introduces them. Chris, this is Terry Trixie. She's a police officer from Portsmouth. They shake hands formally. Then Terry immediately turns back to Howie. I heard you brought loads of people with you, Terry asks. Yeah, Chris was in charge of a sort of commune in London that got overrun, so we managed to get them out and down here. Listen, we need to have a look round with Roger. Can I catch up with you in a bit? Yes, of course. Come back for a coffee as soon as you've finished, Terry smiles at him. Uh, right. Yes, of course. A coffee sounds nice, Howie says. She seemed nice. Chris smiles at Howie as they step away. Going for a coffee later, then, he jokes, putting emphasis on the word coffee. A piss off, Chris. You did that with Clarence and my sister. Don't bloody start on me, Howie laughs at the big man. Right, gents, up here, please. Roger cuts in. Back to business. He leads them up a flight of metal stairs across a small landing area and then up onto the top of the inner wall. The fort was commissioned in the 1850s and completed in 1858. The fort was designed primarily as a mortar battery with over 50 mortar placements, which could be angled to fire both out to sea and inland. The smaller sections we will see are for the mortar placements. These are primarily on the south and north walls. The larger sections are for the RMLs, which means... Rifle muzzle loaded guns, both Dave and Chris say in unison. Very impressive, Roger responds quickly. These forts, especially the larger ones like this, used new techniques and equipment that had never been deployed before. Those small metal rails that loop in the half circle around this section were used for the loading of the cartridges. Roger keeps the information flowing as they slowly walk around the walls to the south side. The ground at the rear of the south wall was dug away, so the sea comes straight up to the side of the wall. It gets a bit shallower when the tide goes out, and over the years, the sediment and mud has built back up. But it's still pretty deep down there. How deep? Chris asks. At high tide, it's well over head height. At low tide, it's probably chest height, Roger admits. We'll have to have lookouts posted at the rear then, Howie says. Why, are you expecting trouble? Roger asks. Chris gives Howie a warning look. We'll talk later, mate. Let's keep going, Howie replies. As you wish, Roger says. After the threat of French invasion finished, the fort was used as public grounds and then recommissioned for the First World War. By 1920, it had passed back into public control. Then the fort was recommissioned in 1939 for the outbreak of the Second World War. During this time, the fort was taken over by the Navy and renamed HMS Spitbank. It was mainly used as an anti-aircraft site, but there were also radar installations, and due to the close proximity of the sea, it was used for the designing and testing of landing craft. Then, in the early 1950s, it again passed into public hands. English Heritage acquired the site during the late 1980s. By that time, most of the interior had fallen into disrepair. Work conducted by English Heritage and the historical societies brought it back to the present glory you see today. You said that you had cannon, Dave says once Roger finished speaking. Yes, we do. Two on the south wall and two on the north wall. They're not the originals, but the type they would have used in that era, Roger replies. And they can be fired, Dave asks. Yes, they can, but only by members of the historical society. But none of them made it here, and I don't think anyone else has the knowledge, Roger says. I can work it out, Dave says. Cannon are very difficult to use, Roger says with a concerned expression. I wouldn't worry. Dave likes blowing things up. Did you know he once blew up a cow, Howie says lightly. A cow? Roger asks, aghast. Oh, yes, you should hear some of the stories Dave has told me. Incredible, really, Howie says, looking about nonchalantly. Really? Sounds fascinating, Roger says, back in the camp voice. They reach the north wall and stand looking out. 
The view takes in the vista of the flat land stretched out in front of them. From the other side, it appeared that the outer wall was higher, but the design was well thought out, and the inner wall is raised slightly higher to allow a clear view, but with the ability to drop down to a lower section. Two sections of the front wall jut out, with large, flat platforms situated on top of the inner wall. A huge cannon rests on each buttress, the wide, dark mouth facing out to the flat lands. Big cannon, Howie remarks. Dave examines the cannon closely, feeling along the surface and peering at the rear end. Finally, he stands back up and nods. Roger, I apologise for being rude, but can you give us a few minutes, please? Howie asks. Why, yes, of course. Call me when you're ready. Roger walks off a respectable distance and turns to face the other direction. They'll come from that direction for sure, Howie remarks, looking out to the houses in the distance. And I wouldn't be surprised if they come round the back too, he adds. But if the tide is low enough, Chris says, but that's only a matter of six hours or so. Priorities. We need to make everyone aware of what's happening. We don't tell them details of how we plan to deal with it, just what the threat is. We know Darren was turned for a while before we knew about it, so we have to assume any of these could be turned too. I think we'll tell everyone what the threat is. Then we make secretive arrangements, Howie says. It's actually an old tactic, Chris explains. In old days, when kings suspected a traitor, they would give each general a set task. Some of them would be fake tasks and some real. All of the generals were told not to discuss their tasks with any of the others. Can we do that? Howie asks. No reason why not, Chris replies. Right, so we've got a massive zombie army coming for us. What do we do? Howie asks, staring out over the walls. Thin the numbers down before they get here, Dave replies. And we keep thinning the numbers down until we can either meet them equally in battle or they leave. I don't think they will leave, and the numbers will be huge by the time they get here. We need scouts out there, so we get notice of when they arrive. We should gather all the weapons in and see which ones will be best. Make sure ammunition is distributed evenly. Dave, these cannon could be fired, but I guess they don't actually fire cannonballs. Can we use something else? Howie asks. Grape shot. Lots of little metal things that will spread out like a shotgun, Dave replies. Good. How about the GPMG? Can we get that up here to fire down, or is it better on the vehicle? There's a long slope over there. We should be able to get the Saxon up here, Chris replies, looking back towards the south wall. Howie turns to see a long, wide, grassed slope leading up from ground level to the top of the inner wall. Perfect. We can get the Saxon up here with Jamie sniping, see if he can take Darren out early in the game, Howie says. If we organise quickly, we can dig pits, use spikes and caltrops. If there's enough black powder, we could rig something up in the housing estate too, Dave says. Caltrops? Howie asks. Sharp metal spikes hidden in the ground that pierce the feet. It won't kill them, but it will cause horrible injury and slow them down, Chris replies, for Dave. I like it. And the spikes? Howie asks again. Put them in the ditch and cover them with something, or dig pits and cover them up, Chris explains. They're called punji sticks. Punji sticks? Sounds nice, Howie says. I like the sharpened bamboo canes. Yeah. Wood or metal will do it. Well, we've got a lot to do and not much time to do it in. If you're both happy, we'll get everyone together, tell them what's happening and sort out who can do what according to skills and materials we have available. Once we've done that, we'll set up in one of those rooms and use runners to tell them what we want done, Howie says, the confidence and natural leadership showing in his voice. Agreed, Chris responds, and Dave nods firmly. Roger, thanks for that, mate. We need to get everyone together. How can we do that? Howie calls out. Everyone? That's a lot of people, Roger replies in a business-like manner rather than camp. Yep, I know, but it's very important. The Saxon has a loudspeaker on it. Can we get that inside and everyone gathered round somehow? Right? Yes, of course. Leave it with me. I'll get some people on it now, Roger replies quickly before scampering off back down to ground level. It's going to be a big fight, Howie says after a pause. It will be, Mr. Howie, Dave replies. How many of these fights have you had so far? Chris asks. A few, Howie replies quickly. Chris looks to Howie and Dave to see the dark looks on their faces. 
There's going to be a whole lot of them, Chris says softly. Fuck them. We'll win, Howie says in a firm voice. I stare out at the flatlands and look to the housing line in the distance. Dave is by my side, Chris a few steps away. I hear noise behind me and turn to see Clarence and Malcolm climb up to stand with us. No words are spoken. We look to the view before us and each of us thinks of what is to come. After a few minutes, I hear more noise behind me. Blowers and Cookie are coming to tell me they have been relieved by some of the fort's guards. They're joined by Tucker chasing after them noisily to try and catch up. They sense the mood and join us looking out spread out in a line. I almost don't hear the stealthy Jamie until he is standing at the end of the line, sniper rifle hanging from his shoulder. We stare at what we know is coming our way, what we know is coming to wipe us out. The hatred they have for us, for me, is incredible, and thoughts pass through my head that maybe if I offered myself to them, they would leave the rest alone. But I know that isn't true. They won't stop until every last one of us is taken and turned. Can I do this? Can I fight these things again? Maybe we should turn and run. But the sea is behind us and there is nowhere to run. We could take boats and ships and sail away, but more of them will be there to meet us, wherever we go. We don't have boats or ships for several thousand people. Running is useless. Even if we used every vehicle we could find, they will seek us out. We need food, water, warmth and rest. They need nothing. Injuries hurt us. Blood loss makes us weak. Nothing less than death stops them. My head spins. I feel like I'm drowning. I'm in too deep and I can't go anywhere or do anything else now. I drag Dave across the country to get Sarah and I pick those lads up on the way. Why did they follow me? I'm not a leader, not a soldier. I can't do this. Self-doubt and fear grow in me. I had Sarah to fight for before. I had something to keep me going. But she's safe now. And without that driving motivation, I don't know if I can do this again. The cost is too much. If I fail, then they all fail. They all die. I think of McKinney. Poor McKinney. He followed me and I let him down. He died because of my mistakes. I taunted them and fueled my revenge by killing too many. The loss of my parents provoked me, and I went after them. Poor McKinney followed me and did what I asked, and I watched him die. I held his sweet face, and he knew he was dying. I feel sick, weak, and pathetic. But then I look to my left and to my right, and I see those men and boys staring out. The fixed eyes, the set expressions. No words are spoken. No words are needed. I look behind me to the people going about mundane tasks in the fort, washing clothes, playing with children, and walking between the tents. Smoke drifts up lazily from the cooking points. The people look like normal people, trying to make sense of their worlds torn apart and destroyed. They are not safe. Sarah is not safe. None of us are safe. The fort won't protect us forever. At some point, they will get through and then we will all be taken. The men beside me look resolute and ready, but I feel anything but that. I don't feel ready for this. We turn and start walking back down the slope. Each step feels heavy and wrong. I feel fake. These battle-hardened men keep looking at me like I have the answers. These are soldiers that have fought in proper wars. They were trained and taught tactics and strategies. I'm a supermarket manager. I don't belong here on this slope with these men. I belong down there with the other survivors. Who am I to take this on and show the way? Who am I to think I could even breathe the same air as these professionals? As we stride down, the people of the fort stop and watch us. The sounds of the camp all cease. Conversation stills into silence. And children stop playing. The new arrivals lining up for checking and details all stand and watch. We are higher than them. We stride like warriors. They know we have fought and will fight again, but they don't know what's coming. They look up, and I see many faces looking directly at me. Don't look at me. I'm nothing. I shouldn't be here, let alone out in front with these men following me. I can't do this. Chris can lead. He's a proper leader, and he should take this from now, not me. 
We keep walking, and I notice Dave glancing at me. But I feel ashamed, and I can't look back at him. The others walk in silence behind us. We get to the bottom, and then have to walk through the camp to get to the front area. I can't help but look to the people standing watching me as I pass. Their faces look drained and old. Their skin is taut and tight from the lack of food and sleep. Dirty children with unwashed faces stand and stare at the heroes as they pass. The heroes led by a phony, a fake, a nothing. I can feel my leg swinging with each step. I'm aware of each step and the thousands of eyes standing in silence to watch me. I understand that Roger has spread the word that we need to speak to them all, but suddenly I am not the man to do it. The pressure of so many lives depending on me is too much. Just Dave and I running round quiet streets was one thing. Nothing could touch Dave and there was no risk to him, so there was no pressure. All I had to do was get to London and get Sarah. But I made the recruits think I was something special, that I could lead them. I made them believe in me. We reached the Saxon and I see Curtis Graves standing by the open driver's door. He nods at me as I get closer and respectfully moves out of the way, showing deference to the leader, showing that he was in my place, but now that I'm back, he will stand aside. I am a joke, and none of these men should show respect to me. I turn to see the thousands of fort occupants walking towards us, crowding around the Saxon to hear what we have to say. My stomach flips and I feel sick, my throat is instantly dry. There are thousands of eyes all watching me, waiting for me to speak, and more are coming. The new arrivals move away from the line. I recognise some of their faces from the night before. I see Sarah pushing through the crowd to stand by the side of Clarence. Clarence is a man mountain. He looks the part, big and tough. He should do this. He has a deep voice and looks hardened from years of fighting. Chris is a big man too and looks like a leader but they both look to me. Chris has shown deference too. He could step forward and do this and these people would listen to him and believe him. Why has he stepped back? Why is he doing this? Can't he see I'm a fake and out of my depth? Leaning into the Saxon to draw the handheld microphone feels like swimming through mud. My hand reaches out through treacle to switch the microphone on as Nick drops down from the lookout hole on position with the GPMG. You should climb up top, Mr Howie, so they can all see you. Nick smiles at me as he clambers out of the rear doors. I pull the cord and realise it's very long. Long enough for me to climb up on the top. I wish it wasn't. I wish I could sit in here, hide away and close my eyes and they would all go away. But instead, I persist in continuing my farce and I clamber out onto the front of the Saxon and then up onto the top. I stand up straight and my legs feel like they will buckle as soon as I look at the thousands of faces all staring at me. The whole fucking lot of them are staring at me, watching and waiting for the promised speech, the news they have been told I will deliver. I lift the microphone to my mouth. My thumb hovers above the button. I look down. Dave is looking out at the crowd. Everyone else is watching me. Cookie and Blowers, Tucker, Sarah standing next to Clarence, Chris and Malcolm with arms folded and legs apart. Jamie, Curtis and Nick stand together. They're closer to the Saxon than the rest, separating themselves from the main. I hesitate as my thumb starts to depress the button. I freeze. I can't speak. I look at Sarah and I see a proud look on her face. Her brother is standing on top of a military vehicle addressing a crowd of thousands. Why can't she see I'm a fake? She must see I have frozen. What do I say? What do I tell them? There's a massive army of undead zombies coming to eat you, but don't worry, I'm here, and even though I have no training or skills, I'll protect you. Fuck off. Get off, Howie. Get down and let a real warrior do this. I scream at myself as I feel the panic rising within me. I scan the crowd as the fear threatens to consume me. Faces old and young are waiting patiently. It feels that I look at each and every face in that crowd and they see me for what I am. I look down and see Dave staring at me. His eyes lock on mine. He knows I'm freezing. He can see right through me. Our eyes lock 
and something passes between us. A warrior born to fight staring at me hard, passing a message. His gaze is intense, so intense. He nods at me just once, and that's enough. I look back up at the crowd and press the button down. My voice booms out, strong and confident. There is an army of thousands of those things coming for us. Tens of thousands. Maybe more. They're coming, and they won't stop until every last one of us is dead or turned into one of them. Concerned expressions abound. This isn't why they came here. This isn't what they were expecting. They are coming, and nothing will stop them from getting here. The army has gone. The police are gone. There is no government, and no one is coming to save us. Behind you is the sea, and there is nowhere left to run. This fort is strong, but they will get through and they will kill every last one of us. Fear and panic grips him, and tears start streaming down faces as parents clutch their children close. We've all lost loved ones. Just in one week we've lost everything we knew. Our friends and families have all been taken from us. And now they will come and try to kill us. The way of life we had is gone and will never come back. All that remains is what we have here and now. This is it. There is no rescue party coming. No fighter jets or warplanes that will wipe them out. This isn't a nightmare that will end. This will happen. I wait and let those words sink in. They need to know how bad this is. We are few compared to the size of them. We are tiny. But there is one thing we have that they don't. We have life. We have life within us. And if you want that life to continue, then we have to fight. One week ago, I was the same as you, living normally and working towards the future. But in that one week, I've changed. I decided not to just wait and let them come for me. I fought back. I met Dave and then together we fought back and since then we haven't stopped killing them. These brave young men you see in front of me, they joined Dave and me and together we fought back and we took them down. We took them down for killing our families and taking away our loved ones. We did not run away and hide. We went to them and we fought and we are still here. We learnt that if we stand together, we can survive. We went to London, and our small group joined with Chris. Then together, we fought against thousands of them. One small group of men took the fight to them, and we walked away from it. We lost men, but only a few. And for each one of ours they took, we took down many of theirs. We showed them we are not scared and we do not fear them. Our small group took hand weapons and attacked them. They're dead already, and they don't feel pain. Blood loss doesn't hurt them like it hurts us. If we bleed, we get weak. They don't. The only way to kill them is by a massive loss of blood, or by taking out the head and the brain. We've learnt that, so we adapted and we took them down. I can feel my voice rising. Now we are here, with you, and this is clear. If we hide, they will find us. If we run, they will catch us. If we stand still and let them, they will take us. So what else can we do? I'll tell you what I want. I want to show them we will not hide, and we will not run, and we will not stand still. We will fight. We will take as many of them down as we can. We may lose, but to the last man we will fight back. They are undead. They are evil. They do not have the right to walk amongst us or take our air. They have taken everything from us. This place here, this is ours. And they will not take it from us without a fight. These men in front of you have stood on the line and survived. On this occasion, we got beaten back, but many times before we took ground from them, not only surviving, but winning. When they come, we will be ready. We will prepare and do whatever it takes to make ready. Not one person here will sleep or rest until we are ready. There is no choice in this. Every man, woman and child must be prepared to fight. There is no hiding away and letting the bigger boys fight for you. 
We will meet them and we will fight them and the last one standing will go down fighting. I roar out at the crowd. Chris smiles and turns to stare out at them. Clarence follows his lead and I see all of them turn to face the crowd. I see defiance creeping in. Firm looks as expressions harden. Men cross their arms and women lift their heads to stand proud. We have the right to be here and they do not. This will be hard, harder than anything you can imagine, but we will work and prepare and then we will meet them and show them no fear, for we shall stand proud. What do we need to do this? We need tools, weapons, we need to know who can make things, fix things, engineers and mechanics. We need foraging parties to go out and bring us the things we need to prepare. We need you to listen to the instructions we give and accept those instructions without argument. We need you to work and toil and then at the end of that we will need warriors, fighters, brawlers and scrappers. And most importantly, we're going to need buckets of coffee to keep us awake. I get a few smiles and nods from this. We can do this. We are few here at the front and have shown that we can fight back. We did not roll over and accept it. We're humans, and throughout history, we have fought with each other. But now at this time and this place, all differences are set aside, and we stand together and we fight together. And if needs be, we will die together. But they will know that we did not weaken and we did not run. I see the change in them. Faces look ready. Men look to one another with pride on their faces, and women stand straight and true, ready to fight to protect their own. Stand with us, and show those things that we are not to be touched, I nod once, firm and strong, and start to clamber down to an explosion of cheering. Thanks, Dave, Howie says quietly after jumping down from the Saxon and sliding over to the small, quiet man. What for, Mr. Howie? You know very well what for, Howie smiles at him. I don't know what you're talking about, Dave replies. Okay, mate, thanks anyway, Howie says again, still smiling at the glint in Dave's eye. There is a sudden excitement and air of action within the group. Howie's words have stirred them motivated them, and given the opportunity, they would charge out of the fort now and attack the zombie army with just forks and spoons. Good speech, Howie, Chris calls out over the noise from the thousands of voices all speaking at the same time. Thanks, mate, Howie replies. Seriously, I've heard some caulkers before, normally from some officer who'll be safe in the base when we charge out, but that was good. You told them the truth. I got them going, Chris says, closer now, but still having to raise his voice. Yeah, Howie says, feeling just a little embarrassed. Honestly, Howie, it was good. Typical British spirit, that was, Malcolm joins in. Well, I had to tell him something, Howie says, and the microphone is still there. You can have a go if you want. No, no, honestly, it was good stuff, Malcolm laughs. Hey, Howie, that was great. Sarah appears at his side, still accompanied by the giant Clarence. Thanks, sis, Howie replies, uncomfortable with all the praise that is being heaped on him. Right, we need somewhere private to work, he says to Chris and Dave. They both nod in return, and Chris strides off to find Roger. Why the secrecy? Sarah asks, concerned. That lad, Darren, he was turned for some time before we knew. Any one of these could be the same so we can't risk everyone knowing exactly what we're doing. Oh, that makes sense. Sarah looks around, staring at the many faces. It's possible. There's too many here to check everyone, and Darren wasn't bitten or scratched that we knew about, Howie says. So for safety's sake, we have to assume any of them could be. He looks around at the crowd. Their faces suddenly look sinister. Plots being hatched and plans being made. Howie... Roger has a room for us that we can work from. You ready? Chris calls out, walking towards him. Yes, mate, I'm ready. Who are we taking with us? I was thinking you, me and Dave, definitely. I would like Malcolm and Clarence, too, if you're okay with it. Any of yours? Chris answers. 
Blowers is good, but then we'd have to ask Cookie too. That pair are joined at the hip. I think we'll get them initially, then stick them on the door to prevent anyone else walking in. That sound okay? Hmm. Maybe we should just go with you, Dave and me, then. Chris rubs his bearded chin. I know what you mean, but Malcolm and Clarence are good, experienced blokes. It would be good to have their input, Howie replies. What if they're infected, though? Chris asks. True, any of them could be. Fuck it, any of us could be, for that matter, Howie says. OK, so we get Doc Roberts in with us initially. He checks us over first, then a visual check on each other, and we crack on, Chris suggests. Yep, sounds good to me. We need everyone to meet over at the south wall so we can talk quietly, Howie replies. You go, I'll round them up and send them on, Sarah says. Thanks, Sarah. Are you sure you don't mind doing that? Howie asks. No, it's OK. I'll get Clarence to stand over them while I smile sweetly, Sarah laughs, leading the big man away with her hand on one of his meaty arms and his face going bright red again. It takes many minutes to walk to the south side of the fort and the rooms set aside by Roger. The survivors stop to shake hands with Howie and Chris at every few steps, patting them on the back and calling out as they pass. At first, Howie tries to move on quickly, but after the first few people, he gets a mischievous glint in his eye. Hey, don't just thank me. Dave and Chris here did as much as me, Howie replies, then watches as the people move on to offer handshakes to Chris and Dave. Chris takes it in his stride, smiling good-naturedly and making comments while looking them in the eye, inspiring confidence and looking every inch the warrior leader. Dave, on the other hand, looks aghast at the many hands being thrust in front of him, knowing that to refuse would cause offence, but clearly hating the idea of touching so many people. Don't forget to smile, Dave, Howie calls out as they work their way through the crowd. Dave glares back as he frantically wipes his hand on the back of his trousers between each handshake. Howie and Chris both laugh as they watch Dave trying to smile, the corners of his mouth turning up and showing teeth, which looks very strange on the normally impassive face. Eventually they break through to the far side as Dave pulls a bottle of antibacterial spray from his pocket and starts cleaning his hands. Sorry, Dave, I couldn't resist it. Your face was a picture, Howie laughs as Dave offers him the spray bottle. It's OK, Mr Howie, Dave says, vigorously rubbing his hands. Is it here? Chris asks, looking at the south wall looming above them. Several doors set into the wall are spread along the ground floor. I don't know. Where's Roger? Howie replies. Cooey, gentlemen, over here, Roger calls out, leaning out of a doorway further up and waving an arm at them. They walk up and enter the door. The room is big and square with a solid-looking old table in the middle. Large, rolled-up sheets of paper lie on the top of the table. Howie looks up to see a single electric bulb hanging down. You've got power, Howie asks, as Roger turns the switch on. These rooms have a dedicated generator supplying power. You can't turn all the lights on at the same time, but it will mean you can work privately with the door closed, if you need to, Roger replies. Through that door are more rooms. Some of them have old camp beds and chairs if you need to rest. Let me know if you need anything. This is great. Thank you, Roger. Where will you be? Howie asks. Just a few doors down. That's where Sergeant Hopewell is working from and the hospital is further down, Roger replies. Oh, there's more of you, he adds, backing away from the door as the recruits and more of Chris's men start piling in. They chat quietly as they wait for everyone to arrive. Nick, can you nip down a few doors and see if Sergeant Hopewell and Ted are there, please, mate? Howie asks. No worries, Mr Howie, Nick calls out, disappearing out of the door. Howie looks amongst the group crowded into the room. The recruits are chatting to each other, now mingling more with Chris's men and women left from the commune. Howie thinks of the losses they took last night and the image of McKinney flashes back into his mind. We can grieve later, he mutters. Did you say something, Howie? Chris asks. No, mate, just talking to myself, Howie replies. First sign of madness, Chris smiles as he looks back to the room. Don't even joke about that, Howie laughs. What are those on the table, Dave? Dave has unrolled some of the large sheets and is bent over, studying them. Maps and plans of the fort and surrounding areas, Dave replies. Hello, what's all this then? 
Ted booms out as he strides confidently into the room, followed by Sergeant Hopewell and Terry, who immediately smiles at Howie. You never came back for that coffee, Terry admonishes him. Hi, Terry. Uh, well, kind of been busy, Howie replies, feeling Chris and a few of the others watching him. That's OK. I heard your speech. It was amazing, Terry says, staring with big blue eyes directly at Howie, her pink lips revealing perfect white teeth as she smiles again. Oh, yeah, uh, thanks, Terry. Howie feels himself starting to blush. Hi, I'm Sarah, Howie's sister. Sarah steps forward, becoming aware of her brother's discomfort. They start chatting as Howie discreetly steps over to Chris. I don't know you very well, Howie, but I've not seen you nervous before, Chris says quietly. I always get nervous around pretty girls, Howie whispers back as Chris throws his head back, laughing loudly and drawing attention from the whole room. I've seen you charge into thousands of those things, Chris says, still unable to use the word zombies, and then give a rousing gung-ho speech to thousands of people, and you get nervous around one pretty girl? Shh, keep your voice down. Oh, bollocks, I think she heard you, Howie mutters, seeing Terry staring over at him. I think we're all here, Malcolm says, as Doc Roberts enters the room with his white lab coat flapping open. Thank fuck for that, Howie mutters again, grateful for the reprieve. Can someone close the door? Thanks. Right, most of us know what's coming our way, and these people will be looking to us for confidence and reassurance. I know we're all tired and have had enough, but without us, they don't stand a chance. The plan is that a few of us will be working from here and sending out instructions for what's needed. And we expect you to see them through, Chris steps in. From now on, only those with a reason are to go up onto the walls, and I expect each of you to try and make sure that happens. We know that people can be infected and either not know it or hide it very well, so we will be taking every precaution to prevent all of our plans from becoming known. If you're given a task, please do not question it or discuss it with anyone else. Debbie, we will need a list of skills and we're going to need runners too. People that can run out and pass messages or find the people we need, Howie says. OK, I've got more lists than you'll ever need and I'm only a few doors down. Also, we've got a pool of bored older kids that need something to do. We can use them as runners. I'll organise that and have them nearby, Debbie replies. Good. We also need guards on the gate. I don't want to tell the people out there what they can and can't do, but for now, we need to restrict who goes in and out, Chris continues after Sergeant Hopewell finishes. There's some rooms back there to relax in, or outside, but stay close and wait for further instructions. Has anyone got any questions? Weapons, sir. We got some. The people out there have some too, and I think there's probably some more knocking about. Are we going to centralise them and work out who has what? One of Chris's men shouts out from the back. Good point. We'll cover it and make sure they're distributed to the right people and in the right place, Chris answers. We're going to need sleep. We've been going all day yesterday and all night. If we work through the night and then fight tomorrow, we'll be dropping like flies, a man says from the front, half-dressed in a police uniform. Try to sleep when you can, rest when you can, but ultimately, tough shit. If they come and we're not prepared, we'll die. Simple as that, Howie replies quickly and without humour. An awkward silence follows, with the armed men and women looking down at their feet, avoiding Howie's intense stare. But, Mr Howie, we're exhausted and we've been fighting and going for a long time. We can't keep going like this, the man whines, rubbing his forehead. OK, mate, I'll tell you what. Why don't you fuck off and get some sleep then? Go and sleep and feel sorry for yourself and whine that no one is giving you a suitable rest period. Even better, we'll send someone to the massive zombie army and ask them nicely to please wait so we can all have a nice sleep. Howie's voice rises as he speaks and the darkness spreads across his face quickly. I'm sorry, zombie army, but we're tired and you're pushing us too hard. Get this, mate. We are all going to die and become brain-eating zombies if we don't do whatever it takes. Yeah, I get that, but listen, there's only so much we can take before we just drop, the man carries on, oblivious to the whining tone of his own voice. Man up and deal with it or die! 
Dave's voice booms out, suddenly causing everyone to jolt backwards. The man goes to speak again, but Dave steps forward with lightning speed and stands nose to nose with him. What? Do you have something else to say? Dave roars at him. No, nothing, the man replies, avoiding Dave glaring at him and staring down at his own feet. Do you want to die? Dave bellows. No. Do you want to live? Yes, the man replies quietly. Moaning and whining is more infectious than those things out there. If I hear you moaning again, me and you will have an issue. Is that clear? Yes, he mutters. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to whine. I lost some good mates back there and I'm in shock. But you're right and I apologise to you and everyone else in here, the man says, turning back to face the room with a look of shame. Another one of Chris's men steps forward and rests his hand on the man's shoulder, nodding gently at him. Debbie, can you get onto those lists and have the runners ready? Tucker, would you mind arranging for some food and cleaning supplies to be brought over? Howie asks, breaking the silence. Yes, of course. Uh, is there anything else? Debbie asks. No, that's it. Get some rest while you can, but stay close, Howie says. The door opens and Debbie files out first, followed by Ted. Howie turns to see Terry coming back into the door. The sunlight catches her golden hair, framing her soft skin and casting an angelic halo about her. Howie finds his breath catching in his throat as she smiles at him. She is beautiful, he thinks, staring at her with an open mouth. You'll catch flies, she says quietly. What, eh? Howie says quickly, snapping back to reality. Sarge said for me to stay close and act as your liaison officer, Terry says. Are you okay, Howie? Yep, he replies too quickly. Now, I wouldn't do this for anyone else, as I'm not a bloody secretary, but I'm going to get you some strong coffee and stay here while you drink it. Got it? She says, seriously. Oh, that sounds lovely, Terry. We need to speak to Doc Roberts for a few minutes anyway, Howie replies. Did someone say something about coffee? Chris calls out, looking up from the maps on the table. I'll come with you, Sarah interrupts, knowing what the men need to do. They leave the room, and Howie calls out for Blowers, asking him to prevent anyone coming in from the back rooms for a few minutes. Blowers nods once and turns to face the other way, standing with his arms folded and blocking the door. Doc, shall we? Shall we what, Chris? You asked me to come here, but I don't know why. Dr. Robert snaps back in his usual clipped tones. Doctor, we need to make sure as best we can that none of us three are infected. Darren, one of my lads, was infected for a while before he turned. And we can't risk any of us three turning while we are planning, Howie explains as the doctor holds up a hand to stop him talking. Right, got it, I understand. Gentlemen, you are going to be planning the defence from here, and if one of you is infected, then you could potentially let the other side know about the plans, is that it? Yes, Howie and Chris say in unison. There is no sure way of checking without blood tests, but we don't have time for that. There are some telltale signs we have learnt. An increase in body temperature, an increased heart rate. I'll do the best I can and check you visually. Strip off, the doctor commands. Howie and Chris shrug at each other and start to slowly peel their clothes off. Dave doesn't hesitate and is stripped naked within a minute. Dr. Roberts starts with Dave, checking his temperature first, then listening to his heart rate. He examines his eyes closely, shining a bright light into the pupils, and then into his ears. After that, the doctor conducts a very close visual check, examining each inch of skin to check for scratches or open wounds. Turn round, the doctor orders, and starts checking Dave from behind, first his back, then down to his buttocks and then his legs. Bend over, the doctor commands, shining a torch into Dave's backside. I can see that light shining out of your mouth, Dave, Chris jokes. Clean and healthy as far as I can tell. Uh, Chris, you're next. The doctor drops down onto his knees to examine Chris's legs, and after a few minutes, the doctor pauses and stares over at Dave. Howie and Chris realise the same thing and both stare over at him. You can get dressed now, Dave, the doctor says quietly, as the door opens and Terry steps in, holding a large metal flask. Oh my god, Terry fumbles with the heavy flask, staring at the three naked men standing behind the table. Howie and Chris both quickly cover their privates as Dave spins around to face the other way. Uh, I'll leave this here, Terry says, flustered as she walks further into the room and places the flask on the table. 
glancing at Howie as she does so. We're just being examined by the doctor, Howie says feebly. All at the same time, Terry says quickly, then sees the doctor crouching down examining one of Chris's kneecaps. Oh, hi doc, she says, and smiles at Howie trying to cover his bits with both hands. I'll leave you to it. She smiles and walks out as Chris bursts out laughing. That wasn't funny, Howie groans to the sound of Blower's stifling laughter from the doorway. I think she enjoyed it, Chris laughs. Stop laughing and stand still, please. Now turn round and bend over, the doctor orders, oblivious to the interruption. They have to approach from the front. The fort is built onto this spit, Chris says, running his finger around the outline of the land on the map. They cannot attack from the sides or rear in any great numbers, so at least we know to expect a frontal attack. The three of them pour over maps, drinking strong coffee, after being left with explicit instructions from Dr. Roberts to report any changes in body temperature and to watch each other closely. OK, so we know which way they're coming. We've got a large, open, flat land in front of us with two big banks, one of which drops down into a type of dry moat. Before that, We've got the housing estate, how he continues, describing the area. If I can use that black powder, I should be able to rig up some traps within the housing estate, Dave cuts in. What sort of thing, how he asks. I don't think we've got any cows to blow up. I'll have to have a look round and see what's there first, but the amount of numbers they're bringing means they will have to funnel through the estate, Dave replies. Cows? Chris asks, puzzled. Dave once blew up a cow to take out an enemy target, Howie explains. Oh, was that you? We heard about that, Chris says. And a refinery too, Howie adds. You did the refinery. We were on standby for that. Christ, that went up, didn't it? You should definitely rig the estate then, Chris says. How many will you need, Howie asks. Just one other. Jamie, Dave replies. Yeah, good idea. How about you take a few more and place them for spotters? Put them out as far as you can, Howie says. OK, Mr Howie. We'll take a couple of vehicles and use one of them as the furthest obs point. Do they have any spare radios here? Check with Debbie. Those radios that we used yesterday. Will they reach into the estate from here? Howie asks. Not likely, Chris replies, shaking his head. Dave, see if you can source some more. We will need constant radio contact with you, and make sure you can get back quickly if it goes bent, Howie says. OK, Mr Howie, Dave replies, gathering his backpack and assault rifle, before heading out the door to find Jamie, who is sitting patiently in the sun. You're with me, Dave says to him. OK, Jamie replies, instantly on his feet and ready. Howie walks into the back room to find several of the recruits and Chris's guards dozing quietly. Blowers, can you get Cookie, Nick and Curtis to come in, please, mate? Howie asks, keeping his voice low. On it, Mr Howie, Blowers replies, instantly awake and alert. Within minutes, he rounds the others up and leads them back into the room with Howie and Chris. Lads, between the four of you, I want to make sure the top of the walls stay clear from anyone else. Curtis, I want you to get the Saxon up onto the inner north wall. The slope is wide enough to drive up. Position it so that the GPMG can fire down onto the flat lands. Nick and Curtis, you take the Saxon and swap round between manning the GPMG and making sure no one else goes up on the wall. Blowers and Cookie, I want you both on the front gate making sure no one goes outside. Blowers, find a couple of Chris's guards and get them positioned at some of the access points up onto the walls to politely discourage anyone from going up. Got it? How he asks. Yes, sir. Howie gets a chorus of replies as they ready themselves and move out of the room. So that's Dave and Jamie taking care of the estate and putting spotters out, and then the walls and lookouts taken care of. What's next? Howie turns to Chris. Weapons, Chris replies, and steps out of the door to call Malcolm inside. Malcolm, find Roger and get a suitable place to work from. Get an inventory of all the weapons we have and ammunition. Do it as quickly as you can. Also try and find out if there are any gunsmiths anywhere near here that we can raid or make use of, Chris says to him. Malcolm nods back and is gone within seconds. Chris disappears into the back room and drags two chairs over to the table, placing one on each side. Howie pours more coffee and they sit down, examining the maps closely while drinking the strong java. 
I remember reading historical novels about cannon firing grape shot, how he says. If Dave can get those cannon working, we can use them from the tops of the wall. Good idea. Chains, nuts and bolts, anything will do for them, Chris replies, leaning forward to look closely at him. Listen, we can go for a siege situation and pick them off bit by bit. Maybe we don't have to go out and meet them face to face, Howie. It won't work, Chris. If we bed in and one of these thousands of survivors in here turns, all it would take is for them to infect a couple. Those couple get a few each and within minutes we're attacked from inside and outside with nowhere to go. I honestly think we should do what we can to reduce their numbers and pick them off, but then we end it, once and for all, Howie replies, staring back at him. I do agree with you, and I think it's the right thing to do, but I want to be sure we know what we're getting into. I know, mate. I think we need to choose our ground. We can use the estate and flatlands to lay traps and pick them off. The banks and the deep ditch we can use too. That open land between the ditch and the outer wall, that should be our ground. How he says, indicating the area on the map. Chris nods, looking down at the area how he traces with his fingers. It gives us some cover from the cannon firing overhead, plus we get to use the banks and ditches to slow them. It's a big enough area. There it is then. Our ground, how he says quietly. They both stare down at the map, just marks on paper showing the outline of the fort walls and the positions of the embankments and ditch. Who'd have thought it? 150 years ago, this was built to protect us from the French. Now it's being used again to stop a zombie army, how he chuckles. I hate that word, Chris mutters with distaste. We could dig some ditches along the edge of the flatlands by the estate, then put the spikes down in the longer grass and then something after the first bank, how he says. If we put vehicles on this side of the first bank, they wouldn't be seen until they're coming down the sides, Chris cuts in. Okay. So, a load of vehicles set to explode, then they go up the second bank and they've got the deep ditch. Fuck it, let's fill it with petrol and blow the shit out of them, Howie laughs. Why not? As long as we're far back enough, it's a good idea, Chris replies seriously. A knock at the door interrupts them and Terry walks in. You're dressed then, she asks lightly. Dave asked me to give you this. He's got one and said to tell you the spotters have them too. Oh, that's great. How many more have we got? Howie asks. I don't know. Malcolm came in and took all the radios into one of the other rooms further down, she replies. OK, Terry, have we got any diggers or plant machinery here? Howie asks, taking the radio. I'll find out. The sergeant has lists of everything, Terry answers, before smiling at Howie again and heading for the door. That coffee was really nice, by the way, Howie calls out. She turns and smiles back again before closing the door behind her. Howie to Dave. He speaks into the radio, holding the big side button down. Dave receiving. Go ahead, Howie. Radio check. Receiving you loud and clear. Dave to Howie. Roger. Loud and clear this end. Out. Right. Let's go and find Malcolm and see what he's got, Howie says. They step out into the bright sunlight to find guards lazing about, stretched out in the warm sun, leaning against the wall or chatting to each other and the survivors. Howie and Chris stroll down until they reach Sergeant Hopewell's office. I see her sitting at a desk and looking up at Terry. Hi, Mr Howie. Howie turns to see Tom and Stephen walking towards him from the main camp area. Hey, mate, everything all right? Howie replies. Yeah, the sergeant's got us patrolling the camp to show her presence. Everyone keeps asking us when the fighting starts or if they can have weapons, Stephen answers. Stephen, Mr Howie was asking me, not you, Tom says petulantly. No, he wasn't. He was asking both of us, Stephen fires back. I'm the policeman, you're just a community officer, so leave the serious stuff to us. No, Tom, you were a police officer, but Mr Howie said there isn't a police force anymore, so if there isn't one, how can you be a police officer? Ha! We're both the same now. No, but I've been trained more than you, Tom says defensively. Trained in what? How to take a statement? Custody procedures? That doesn't really help us now, does it? I've got more unarmed defence training than you, Stephen. No, you didn't. We both got the same. You just got taught how to use your baton and pepper spray. I know, because we partnered up for the training, you bloody idiot. Lads, listen, I think it's probably fair to say that you're both the same now. But you're both very valued, and it's good you're going round the camp and letting people know you're there, Howie says, diplomatically. 
Ha! Fuck you, Tom Jenkins! Stephen shouts triumphantly as Tom stares at him in horror. I'll leave you to it, lads. Howie chuckles and steps into the office. Terry and Sergeant Hopewell both stare out, shaking their heads. They'll never bloody change, that pair, the sergeant mutters. They seem good lads, though, Howie laughs. Did you find out about the diggers or plant machinery, Terry? Oh, hi, Sarah, I didn't see you there. My job was mainly administration, so I thought I'd put myself to good use. Besides, Patricia here was feeling a little lost, so I said she could stay with me, Sarah replies, indicating the girl sitting further in the room, drawing on some paper. Where's that other woman that was with you? Mary, wasn't it? Howie asks. She's getting cleaned up, then is coming over here, Sarah says. Howie turns back to see Terry standing at a desk loaded with thick piles of paper. Bloody hell, that's a lot of lists, Howie says. Language, Howie, Sarah warns. Sorry, uh, so, about the diggers. Right. So we have compiled a list of all the people within the fort. Name, date of birth and last known address. We added work skills and any former military training or firearms experience, pistol or rifle clubs, that kind of thing. We've divided and subdivided the interior of the fort into sections and allocated people into those sections. So we know roughly the area they should be in. We also appointed a contact person within each section that we can go to them and find out where the section residents are. The idea is that each resident of each section reports to the section contact where they will be in case they're needed, Terry explains. We have also listed every vehicle in the area and if they are usable or if we have access to them with keys. We categorised each vehicle into commercial or non-commercial with a reference to how much fuel the vehicle has and, of course, which fuel type. So in answer to your question, Terry pulls a clipboard from the pile and starts flicking through the lists. You've listed the people that have military experience or firearms knowledge, Howie asks. Yes, Terry answers without looking up. Can you get that list to Malcolm? He's setting up an armory here somewhere. I don't suppose you recorded what kind of firearms they have previously used, have you? Chris asks. Of course we have, Terry replies, still not looking up. We'll get that to him straight away. Ah, here it is. Yes, we have access to three diggers and a cross-reference to the people that can operate them. Terry looks up and smiles, her blue eyes twinkling. Wow, that's great, Howie says, amazed at the volume of work they've undertaken already. Can you get those digger drivers to us as soon as possible? Of course, Mr Howie, Terry says mock demurely as she steps outside. Can I have three runners in here, please? Terry calls out. Within seconds, three slim teenage boys run into the room, almost standing to attention in front of Terry, who runs her finger down the list of vehicles and then starts flicking through the pages of names of the fort occupants. I need you to find George Kimberley from Section 2, Martin Aylesbury from Section 7, and Mark Donovan from Section 18. Bring them back here as soon as possible. Thank you. Terry looks up with a stern face, nodding at the boys to get moving. They run into the thick crowds and weave through the tents and structures. That's brilliant, Howie says, watching the lads sprint away. Are there any kind of blacksmiths here or workshops? There's workshops quite well equipped too, from what Ted told me, Sergeant Hopewell replies. Terry, can you also find engineers, mechanics and metal workers and send them up to us, Howie asks. Of course, leave it with me. I'll get more of those runners out, she replies, examining her lists. Those runners are great, Howie says admiringly. Oh, those boys all like our Terry here, especially when she smiles at them, Debbie says, without looking up from the papers in front of her. I bet they do, Howie says, then instantly blushes as he realises what he said. I mean, uh, I'm sure they do. Shall we go and see Malcolm then? He says, turning to Chris, who is smiling broadly and leaning against the wall. Or we could stay here and watch you trying to pull your foot out of your mouth, Chris replies. Very funny. Thanks for the list, Terry. Uh, We'll be off then, Howie says, turning to see Sarah leaning back in her chair, watching him with amusement. Howie steps out, rubbing his face, groaning softly to himself. Chris comes out, shaking his head silently. They walk down a few steps to find an armed guard outside a set of solid-looking metal gates that lead into a tunnel. Is Malcolm in here? Chris asks the guard. 
Uh, yes, Chris, down there to the right. The guard opens the gate to admit Howie and Chris. They enter the short tunnel and turn right into a large room. Natural light trickles in from barred windows set into the wall. Long workbenches run down one side, and weapons of all types are stacked up next to boxes of ammunition. Malcolm and Clarence work their way through the weapons, checking and clearing. Hi, Chris. We've got quite a lot here, really, Malcolm says, straight to the point. We've got some decent rifles, which would be good on the walls for longer range. We've separated the assault rifles, though some of them are only 9mm, no good for longer range. There's loads of shotguns, too. How about ammunition? Chris asks. You can never have enough rounds, Malcolm replies. We've got quite a lot, but it'll soon go if we get into a period of sustained firing. Did you find out if there are any gunsmiths nearby? Chris asks, picking up one of the rifles from the bench. There's a few, actually, all in a ten-mile radius, Malcolm replies. Clarence, can you get some people together and a couple of vehicles? Vans would be good. We're going to need a foraging party. See Sergeant Hopewell next door. I bet she's got a list of them somewhere, Chris says to the huge man. Got it, Clarence rumbles, putting down an assault rifle. What else do we need? Any kind of weapon you can get. Guns, knives, swords, axes, anything we can use. Also, we'll need nuts, bolts and short chains to make grape shot for the cannon, Chris explains. Clarence, try and get some more arrows too, Malcolm calls out. Arrows, Chris asks, looking about. There's quite a few competition-level archers in here. Have you seen the range and power on modern bows? Malcolm replies, indicating the end of the bench and the modern bows racked up next to a pile of arrows. Fair enough. Get whatever you can, Clarence, Chris says. On it, Clarence replies and steps out of the room. Back in their planning room, Howie and Chris sit down and go over what they've already set in motion, discussing the finite details. There's a knock at the door. Come in, shouts Howie. Hi, we were asked to come here? A middle-aged man enters, followed by two younger men. Hi, thanks for coming. Excuse me asking, but who are you? Howie stands, holding his hand out to the closest one. I'm George, the first man answers. The other two introduce themselves as Martin and Mark. Ah, you must be the digger drivers then, Howie asks. Yeah, we are. Not just diggers, but anything like that, really, George answers. Do you know each other? Chris says, watching the men closely. I've known Martin for years. We worked together before, uh, before this. We only met Mark here, though. When did you arrive? Howie asks. Saturday afternoon. We heard the broadcast and came straight here. Me and Martin didn't have far to come. We live near each other too. Well, we lived near each other. Mark, when did you arrive here? Chris takes over the questions. Sunday morning, sir, Mark answers in a polite tone. I apologise if this is an insensitive question, but did you come with your families? Chris asks. I've got my wife and son with me, sir, Mark says. We've got our wives and children here too, George adds. Have any of you been bitten, scratched or had any direct contact with those... He means zombies. Have you had any contact with the zombies? How he finishes off for Chris. No, sir. I saw them, but we hid in the house and then got down here quickly. They were in the street when we left, but it was daytime and they were slow, Mark says first. Howie looks to George and Martin. Well, we had a spot of bother getting out of our road. There was a couple of them in the way, George says nervously. What did you do? Chris asks. Martin and George look at each other, then back at Chris. We, uh, well, we run them over with the van, George says after a pause. You were all in one van and you ran them over. Did you make contact with them physically, get any blood on you or get cut, bitten or scratched or did any of your families, Chris says, staring hard at them. Uh, no, sir, nothing like that. The van got blood on it, but none of us did, George says as Martin nods in agreement. Chris looks to Howie, nodding once. OK. Sorry about the questions, but we had to be sure none of you were infected or ran the risk of being infected. We have a task for you. 
But before we say anything about it, would you all be willing to have a full medical examination? Harry asks. They each nod and reply they would agree to the exam. After the men are thoroughly examined by the doctor, Chris starts to explain. OK, gentlemen, we need some trenches dug into the ground near the housing line, but we want to do it so we can hide them afterwards, or at least cover them up so they're not easily visible. Is that possible? Chris asks. The three men look to each other, thinking, until George takes a small step forward, nominating himself as the unofficial spokesman. It depends on how deep and how wide, George replies. The grass is long enough out there to cut some down and lay the cuttings across the top. That would cover it and blend in somewhat, but only if it's not too wide or deep. We want it roughly two yards wide so it's not easy to step over or jump and deep enough to put either some spikes in or some flammable material, Howie replies. Oh, I get it. Like a trap for the zombie army, Martin cuts in. Yeah, that can be done. For spikes, you would want a decent drop in there for the body to be impaled, though. Yeah, just a few inches wouldn't do it, unless they were razor sharp, that is. Otherwise, you'd need a couple of feet at least, Mark adds. I reckon we could dig them out about three feet deep and a couple yards wide and be able to cover them over. It won't be pretty, but I reckon we know what you want and we'll do the best we can, George says earnestly, as Martin and Mark both nod. Good. We'll have some guards go out with you to give you some protection. We need to do this now, though. The most important thing is that you do not mention a word of this between here and getting outside the gate. That is vitally important. Is that clear? Sir, we won't say anything, but could you let our families know we'll be back a bit later? They'll only worry otherwise, Martin replies. Of course we will. Chris will show you on the map exactly what we need, and I'll be back in a minute, Howie says, ushering the men over to the table. Chris indicates the area of flatland immediately in front of the row of houses. We need it all the way across the entire width of the spit. Will three of you be enough to do this? Chris asks. Yes, sir. The digging won't take long. Cutting the grass and laying it across will take the longest part. Uh, may I ask how you were going to fix the spikes in? George asks. We're going to speak to engineers next and ask them to arrange it, Chris replies, looking at the experienced man. That's a long strip you're planning, sir, right across the width of the spit, and the spikes will need to be driven in quite a way to hold fast, but done without blunting the ends, especially if you're using metal. Also, where will you get the spikes from? There's a workshop here. We'll find some engineers and mechanics to try and sort them out. You think spikes will be hard to do, then? Chris asks, openly taking their advice. Not impossible, but certainly difficult. We've got enough people here to do it, but if you're concerned of some of them being infected, then it'll be bloody hard for you to trust that many to go outside, George says. OK, good point. We'll see if it can be done. Where are the diggers? Over on the west side, stacked up between the two walls. We managed to get quite a few vehicles in the gap. That's good thinking. Keeps them safe, Chris says. I've got runners telling your families you're busy for a little while. They can go to Sergeant Hopewell next door if they've got any concerns. I've jacked up some guards to go with you. I've had to use some of your people, Chris. Mine are all tucked up. But I've briefed them to what's needed, Howie says, coming back into the room. Whenever you're ready, gentlemen. Howie leads the men out of the planning room and down towards the gate, stopping to speak to Blowers and Cookie, who are leaning against a post, smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee. Their assault rifles are strapped across their shoulders, allowing the rifles to rest at the front. Lads, how's it going? Howie asks as they walk closer. Mr Howie, we're just having a coffee, Cookie replies guiltily. No worries, lads, you don't have to apologise. I know you'll stay alert. Has anyone tried to get in or out? No, we've had a lot of people come and ask us questions, Blowers says, stubbing his cigarette out. How do they seem when they're speaking to you? Howie asks. Nervous and pumped up, to be honest, sir. Like they want to be doing something rather than just waiting, Cookie replies. OK, just to let you know that we're taking these chaps out into the flatlands with some plant machinery, in case anyone questions the noise or anything, Harry explains, as Cookie opens the small walk-through gate for them. They step into the wide lane between the inner and outer wall. The concrete walkway is now covered with a cropped layer of grass 
They turn left and walk down into the area that runs between the two walls. The plant machinery and other vehicles coming into view as the lane bends to the left. Several armed guards are recognised by Howie from back in the commune and, already spoken to, follow at a discreet distance, their weapons gripped and ready. Howie pauses to let the three men walk onto their vehicles. OK, so you know what they're doing. Keep a close eye on them and make sure they don't leave their vehicles and go into the estate. We've got a couple of our people already in the housing area, so be very careful if you have to venture in. In fact, I would say don't go in there unless absolutely necessary and make sure you let us know on the radio. Got it? Howie says to the guards, who nod back as the nearest of the diggers starts up with a noisy roar. We might be sending more people out, but I'll let you know if we do, Howie says, leaving them to it and walking back to the gate. Once inside, he walks slowly back towards the south wall, thinking of the plans they have put in place, a visual image forming in his head. We've got spotters out front, so we should get notified when they arrive. There could be undead already in the estate watching us, but we can't afford the time or people to sweep it clean. And Dave is in that area rigging some traps up. The zombie army has to come this way, so they have to go through the estate. Dave blows some of them up and slows them down. Then they push into the flatlands and into the trenches with either spikes or something else to hurt and hamper them. After that, they have to negotiate the first bank and, hopefully, a load of vehicles set to explode. Then the second bank and the deep ditch. After that, we're on our own. How many will they bring? Will they be armed? Fuck, what if they're armed? We'll be slaughtered. Nothing we can do about that. I suppose we can fall back into the fort if we have to, but it won't take long for them to get through. Mind you, we've got the Saxon up top with the GPMG. We can put more rifles and weapons up there and hopefully the cannon with grape shot, if Dave can sort them out. Thinking all this through, Howie realises how much they're relying on the quiet man, leaving him to rig the estate, which must be a hell of a task, then needing him to work out the cannon too. If they didn't have Dave, they'd be at a loss. Howie knows he would have been dead a long time ago if not for Dave. Thoughts race through his mind as he slowly paces back towards the south wall, oblivious to the many people who stop and stare at the man with the dark hair and dark features. There is something about his manner and appearance, the way he walks slowly, planting each foot in turn, the faraway look on his face that puts them off from disturbing him. A few of the less sensitive ones step forward to interrupt his thoughts, only to find strong hands placed on their arms from the more astute people, holding them back with discreetly shaking heads. Children go quiet as Howie walks through the camp, his mind racing with a thousand images and thoughts, but his face is stony and grave, eyes down and subconsciously avoiding trip hazards and guide ropes stretched out from the many tents. To Howie, it's like a movie in his mind. An image of grotesque decaying forms racing through the estate with sharpened yellowing teeth. The traps fail to go off, then they leap over the pits and surge too quickly past the non-exploding cars, only to fall on the weak lines, devouring and wiping them out instantly. Keep them coming. Keep them running after them until they eventually fall down and die again. But then he has an overwhelming desire to fight them. To stand on that line and face them down. How he thinks back to the feeling of battle, the horror and the fear, the blood and gore, the knowing that at any point he could be taken down and killed, only having his own strength and speed to rely on, the feeling of glory, the sense of doing something that is right, standing with his people and fighting with them, charging into almost certain death, but doing so knowing you're all in it together. The pull of that feeling is hard to ignore, and how he accepts that there is a big part of him wanting that final showdown. Take as many down as you can, Howie, and then fight them. They don't think of fairness or equal sides, so hurt them. Cut them down and do what it takes, because that fight will be the end. Howie snaps back to reality to find that he's in the middle of the camp. There is silence all around him. Howie lifts his head and nods once to the mass of people who stand and stare at him, before walking quickly towards the south wall and back to the reality of planning the impossible. You, you and you two, come with me, 
Dave points to several of the guards nearby, hand-picking the ones he had seen fighting. Serious men with calm expressions, fit and athletic. They get up and make ready, without question. Get some fluids and food, meet us at the gate, Dave says, walking away towards the Saxon, Jamie following behind him. They reach the Saxon, just as Curtis and the rest come out of the planning room. Dave opens the rear doors and climbs in, rummaging through the bench seat cupboards to pull two heavy, bulging canvas bags out. Dave then exits the Saxon to see Jamie staring at the bags. Grenades, Dave explains. Okay, Jamie replies. Leave both of your rifles here, take this and put it on, Dave says, handing Jamie a pistol pouch with belt loops at the rear, the black stock of the handgun poking out. Jamie hands over the two rifles. Dave slides them into the rear as Curtis arrives at the vehicle. We're leaving our rifles here. Take care of them, Dave instructs Curtis. Yes, Dave, Curtis replies, still making the name Dave sound like the word Sarge. Ammunition, Dave says, handing Jamie spare clips for the handgun. I've never used a handgun before, Jamie says. I'll show you, Dave replies. OK. Jamie says, looping the heavy pouch onto his belt to his right side. Ready? Dave asks. Yes, Dave, Jamie replies. They walk towards the gate in silence, each carrying a bag full of grenades over one shoulder. Two quiet men with pistols strapped to their sides, walking silently through the camp. They reach the gate and wait in silence for the other guards to catch them up. Ted appears, smiling. Going anywhere nice? Ted asks. No, Dave replies flatly. Oh, right, Ted pauses, the smile slowly disappearing. We need some vehicles, Dave says. Okay, how many do you need, Ted asks. Three, Dave replies. Anything in particular, Ted asks. No, Dave answers. Ted walks away into a nearby room, selecting keys from a key cupboard. Can you drive, Dave asks Jamie. Yes. Jamie replies. Good, Dave says. Ted returns, handing the keys over as the four guards reach the gate, each of them with a rucksack on their backs. The vehicles are between the walls to the left, Ted says, as they step through the gate. OK, Dave answers. Funny bugger, that one, Ted says to himself, closing the gate behind them. They walk down the lane until they reach the vehicles, Dave stopping to look at the keys, then at the vehicles trying to figure out which key fits which vehicle. You're going on point duty. You each get a radio. One of you has to go to the furthest point out that the radio will reach. Keep checking in on channel two until you lose signal, then come back. The other two, I want on the sides and out as far as the radios will reach. Got it? The guards nod back as they take the radios and switch them to channel two, using the small dial at the top. The one furthest out takes one of the vehicles. The other two, out to the sides. One gets a vehicle and you arrange where the other gets dropped off and the pickup points, in case it goes bent. We keep the other vehicle. You will be there for some time. I will try and get relief for you, but that may not be possible. You are the advance contact points. Without you, we will not have advance warning of when they come. Do not engage and give away your positions. Report back at first sight and pull back to the fort. Got it? Dave says. They each nod. Stay alert, Dave says, handing all of the keys to one of the guards. The man sorts through them, then hands a set to Jamie. For that one, the man points to the first vehicle. You get the vehicle ready, Dave says to Jamie. He nods in return and walks over to get into the driver's side, adjusting the seat and checking through the controls. Jamie glances out to see Dave speaking intently to the other men. Finally, they nod back with very serious faces and break away, heading for their vehicles. OK, Dave says, getting into the front passenger seat. Jamie starts the engine and pulls away slowly. They get to the big vehicle gates on the outer wall, then Dave gets out and pushes the gates open, waiting for the vehicles to drive through. Jamie pulls over to allow the other two to drive on down the road. Dave closes the gates and gets back into the vehicle. Where are we going? Jamie asks as he pulls away. Into the estate. We're going to set some explosives, Dave answers. We also need to sweep as we go. Dave thinks of all that Mr Howie and Chris have to contend with. 
He didn't need to ask if they wanted the area swept. They have enough to think about. Jamie drives down the long, straight road, past the banks and then through the flatlands, finally reaching the housing estate. Drive down to the right, Dave instructs, as Jamie turns the wheel, going down the road between the two rows of houses, one row on the flatland side. Park at the end, Dave says. Jamie pulls the car up at the end of the cul-de-sac. They get out and walk around to the back of the vehicle. Dave pulls his pistol out and indicates for Jamie to do the same. Dave then shows Jamie how to load the ammunition clip and pull the sliding top back to engage the first round. They kick quite a lot. Use a two-handed grip, same as the sniper rifle. Squeeze and fire, Dave says. Can I fire here? Jamie asks. Yes, they won't hear from this distance, Dave answers. Jamie raises the pistol and copies Dave, firing once, the loud retort sounding out into the quiet air. Good. You anticipated the kick without dropping or lifting the weapon. Two shots per target, like this, Dave says, lifting his own pistol and walking towards the front door of the nearest house. As he steps onto the garden path, he fires two shots very close together. The rounds strike the door at mid-height, millimetres apart. Got it. Jamie says, walking towards the same door and firing twice into the same height as Dave hit, both rounds hitting within millimetres. Good. We call it a double tap. Aim for the head, if you can, and be ready to reload quickly. Don't be afraid to put it away and go for bladed weapons if you need to. OK, Jamie answers. Show me a reload, Dave instructs, and watches Jamie eject the clip, catch it with one hand, drop that same hand down and swap for a fresh full clip and slam it home, racking the top back, all within a second or two. Sorry, that was slow, Jamie apologises. That's okay, you'll get faster the more you do it, Dave answers. We'll do the first house together. Okay, Jamie replies. They move up the path until they reach the front door. Dave steps close to the front door and stares at Jamie. How many windows to the front? Dave asks. Two on the ground level, two on the first floor, Jamie replies without breaking eye contact. Describe them, Dave asks. The ground floor, far left, appears to be a lounge window. Net curtains restrict the visibility, but the curtains are drawn back, which indicate the people are either not at home or were not at home when the event happened. The other window looks similar, so it might be a dining room. It does not look like a kitchen, Jamie replies. Upstairs, Dave asks. The far left has partial neck curtains with curtains drawn back, but there is no view of the inside from ground level. The right side is the same, but the curtains are half drawn across. Are the windows closed or are any of them open? Dave asks. I think they're all closed, Jamie replies. OK, it's your first time, so I will allow for that, but in future remember this. We don't think. We know. Got it? Yes, sorry, Jamie replies. Good. Now the door. Tell me about it. Wooden. Inward, opening and hinged on the right, Jamie replies, looking straight at Dave. Good. How many locks and where are they? Central lock on the door handle to the left. Letterbox is situated at standard height. I wasn't able to tell if there are any further locks. Good. How can we tell if the door has further locks? Dave asks. I don't know. Pressure? Yes, Push against the door next to the door handle. Does it yield? Dave asks and watches Jamie push hard. No, Jamie answers. Now, push at the top of the door. Does it yield? Yes, slightly, Jamie answers, then pushes at the bottom. The base yields too. No locks on the top or bottom. Good. So we know that to force entry, we aim for the central lock. Now, do we use a shoulder or a foot? Dave asks. Jamie considers for a split second. A shoulder will risk injury and I don't think people our size could generate enough force. The foot? He asks. Correct. Men the size of Clarence and Chris can use shoulders as they have huge amounts of power and strength. Men our size do not, so we use our feet. But before we do that, what should we do first? Look for a key? Jamie replies. Good. And also? Dave pushes the handle down and the door opens slightly. We check to see if it's actually locked first. Got it. Room clearance, Dave says as they step into the hallway. Working together, we clear as we go. 
One remains at the door facing out, the other enters. We do not lean around corners with our weapons held out, ready to be taken off us. Got it? Got it. Good. We walk in fast, with the weapon held ready for use. We face forward and sweep like this, Dave says, as he enters the first room on the right, pushing the door open with his foot and stepping in quickly. He holds the pistol in the two-handed grip and sweeps the room rapidly, the gun rising and falling as he looks up and down, left to right. Got it, Jamie says. You do that one, Dave says, nodding towards the lounge door opposite them. Jamie mimics Dave, pushing the door open with his foot and sweeping the room quickly, the weapon tracking his facial direction. Good. Now, if we both proceed to the ground floor rear... We leave the stairs behind us and we do not know if upstairs is clear. So one holds at the point of risk while the other advances. I'll hold while you clear the rest, Dave says. Okay, Jamie replies, stepping down the narrow hallway and entering the kitchen. He disappears from view and is gone for several seconds. He walks back out with the weapon slightly lowered, but still held correctly. Clear, he reports. Good. Stand behind me. Dave asks as Jamie walks to stand behind him. Dave raises one hand and makes a fist. This means hold, Dave says, then extends one finger. This means one target, two for two targets, three for three. All of the fingers extended means multiple targets. Got it. Good. If I point the finger like this, it means the target is in that direction. If I point one way, then another, it means one target that way and one target the other. Okay. Good. We'll stick with that for a minute. Going upstairs, we keep the weapon raised to strike the target at the top, taking into account the height difference. Place your feet to the sides of each step. There is less chance of creaks that way. Okay, Jamie says, as Dave lifts his weapon and advances up the stairs quickly and surely, reaching the top and pausing to sweep down the hallway. Corridor ahead, loops back to the front bedroom. Another room on the right, bathroom at the end. I'll hold, you clear the front, Dave says quietly, stepping aside to allow Jamie to move along the few steps to the bedroom. He walks inside and reappears within seconds. Clear, he reports quietly and moves on to the next bedroom. He repeats the action, then moves along to the bathroom. Clear, he then returns back to Dave, weapon lowered. Good, Dave replies. They exit the house and move outside, to the next one, trying the door first, but finding it locked and no key to be found. Aim your strike next to the lock. Do not expect it to burst open on the first hit, Dave says, watching as Jamie steps back and powers his right foot into the door. Jamie watches as the strike hits, then adjusts his stance and pauses for a second, appearing to draw power, then drives his foot forward again with lightning speed. The strike is perfect and the door pops open, causing the frame to splinter from the solid brass lock being forced in. Good, now we move faster. Go, I'll hold, Dave orders. Jamie walks forward, kicking doors open and sweeping the house room by room, reporting clear after each one. Jamie takes the lead on the stairs, leaving Dave to hold at the top. The house is cleared within minutes and they walk back out. That was good, but we have a lot of houses and not much time, so do it faster, Dave says. OK, Jamie replies. The next house is cleared within two minutes and they exit again, moving across the lawns to the next one. My turn, you hold, Dave says as he kicks the door in and enters swiftly, striding from room to room with quick, jerky but controlled movements. He clears each room, then moves straight up the stairs and clears the rest. He's back outside in under a minute. Your movement's much faster than mine, Jamie says as they walk to the next house. Years of practice and drill, but you do not have that luxury. Your turn, Dave says as they reach the door. Jamie quickly checks the door handle. Locked. He presses the top and bottom, steps back and kicks the door hard, forcing it open on the first kick. He enters as the door is still swinging open. Jamie strides into the first room, again mimicking Dave as he quickly checks the four corners and moves back out, then moves on to the next room. They exit the house in just over a minute, again moving down to the next house. Better, keep that pace but stay alert, Dave says, testing the door handle and finding the door unlocked. 
You go again, Dave says as the door swings open. Jamie strides into the lounge on the right, then back out and across the small hallway and into the dining room. He exits and clears the kitchen at the back before moving back and climbing the stairs, pausing at the top for a split second to allow Dave to reach the top step. Jamie advances towards the front bedroom, pausing at the door with his head cocked to one side. He raises a hand and makes a fist, then extends one finger and points to the door. Dave moves up close behind Jamie and listens. He taps Jamie on the shoulder once and waves his extended hand forward, then quickly about turns to watch the rear. Jamie steps forward and pushes the door open with his foot. Walking into the room, he observes an undead standing on the other side of the double bed. The pistol is already tracking with his eyes. He fires two rounds, very close together, into the forehead and is already moving to check the rest of the room as the zombie slumps to the ground, leaving a massive blood and brain spatter on the wall behind him. Clear, Jamie says, exiting the room. Dave enters the bedroom and moves across to look down at the body, then heads back out into the hallway. Good shots. The second was slightly off, though, Dave says. I know, I started to turn away to continue the sweep too quickly, Jamie replies. If you're satisfied that the first shot is enough, then you can start the move, Dave says. OK, I'll keep to the double tap for now to practice, if that's OK. OK, Dave replies. Jamie clears the rest of the rooms and they move on, working house by house, clearing each one in under a minute, then crossing the road to start on the other side. They work back towards where they started. Now we work alone. You start with this one and I do the next. You leapfrog and do the next one and I leapfrog after you. Got it? Dave asks. Got it. Same method? Jamie says. Yes, Dave answers. OK. Jamie walks to the front door and pauses until Dave has reached the front door of the next house. They nod to each other and, in unison, they check the door handle, the top and the bottom, then step back and kick the door open, entering as the door swings open. They work from house to house, double shots ringing out sporadically as they find undead in rooms. The street is cleared within ten minutes, and they each exit their last house, both changing clips and reholstering their weapons as they walk back to the vehicle. How many? Dave asks. Three. You? You know how many I had? You had two. Good. What now? Jamie asks. The next street behind this one. Dave answers. OK, Jamie replies. They move down the central road until they reach the next junction. Once again, two rows of houses run along on each side. You take that side, I'll do this side. Meet back here, Dave says. OK. Ten minutes later, they meet back at the junction, Dave ahead of Jamie but only having to wait for under a minute. How many rounds did I use? Dave asks. Eight. Jamie answers. Four targets. Good. Two more streets and we can start on the explosives, Dave explains, as they walk further down the road. A lead point to Dave. The radio crackles on Dave's belt. Dave to lead point, go ahead. Lead point to Dave. I'm positioned approximately two miles away from your location, testing transmission strength. Dave to lead point. Transmission strong. Can you move further? Yes, we'll do so now. Out. Dave to East Point. Are you in position? East Point to Dave. Roger that. In position now. West Point has retained the vehicle. Dave to East Point. Received. Dave to West Point. Confirm you have retained the vehicle and are you in position? West Point to Dave. Confirm I have retained the vehicle. Confirm I am in position. Dave to West Point. Roger that. Dave to Lead Point. You are now North Point. Received. North Point to Dave. Roger that. Dave to North Point. Switch to Channel 1 and check signal strength to the fort before you move any further. North Point to Dave. Roger that. Doing now. Dave switches the dial on the radio back to Channel 1 and listens for the transmission. North Point to Fort. Radio check. Fort to North Point. Are you forward observation point? Your signal is weak but readable. North Point to Fort. Answer, yes, I am forward OBS point. Likewise, your signal weak but readable. I will hold this position. North Point to Dave. Did you receive the last? 
Dave to North Point and Fort. Roger that. Received the last. North, East and West Points will hold these positions and maintain Channel 1. Dave out. Dave turns to Jamie. Explosives, he says simply. Did you hear that last transmission? Chris asks as Howie enters the planning room. Yeah, Dave's got the spotters in place. Yep, at least we've got eyes on now, so we'll get an advance warning, Chris replies. You okay, mate? He asks, taking note of the expression on Howie's face. I'm fine, mate. Was just thinking it all through as I walked back, Howie replies. There's a lot to think about, Chris concedes. But all we can do is try, Howie. I know, mate. Any news on the engineers? I spoke to Sergeant Hopewell and she sent runners out. Did the digger drivers get away okay? Howie nods back, staring down at the plans on the table. Where do we put the soil that they dig out, he says. They seem experienced men, Howie. I'm sure they will figure it out and put it somewhere. Out of sight, Chris replies. Wouldn't they need dumper trucks to carry it away? Hang on, Chris says, reaching for his radio. Fort to guards with the digger units, fort to guards with the digger units, Chris repeats several times. Digger guard to fort. Sorry, it's noisy here. Go ahead, a voice booms out, the sound of loud engines in the background. Fort to digger guards, make sure the soil taken out is disposed of, out of sight. Digger guard to fort, repeat your last, please. Fort to digger guard, make sure the soil taken out is hidden from sight. Digger guard to fort, you want us to work all night? Fort to digger guard, answer no. I want the soil from the holes hidden. Digger unit to fort, roger, will do. Bloody hell, they're going to wake the dead, Chris says, shaking his head and putting the radio down on the table. Bit late for that, mate, Howie jokes. A knock and Terry enters, immediately smiling at Howie. There are some engineers here for you, she says. Ah, great, Howie replies, stepping to the door and finding several men waiting outside. Come in, chaps, Howie smiles at them, opening the door wide. They walk into the room, looking about with a keen interest at the interior, and then head straight to the plans on the table. I'm Howie, this is Chris. Nice to meet you all, Howie says, politely shaking hands with the men, one by one. Sorry, is this the room for the engineers? A middle-aged woman appears at the door, leaning in. Yeah, hi, I'm Howie, come in. Hello, I'm Kelly, the woman replies, shaking hands with Howie, then Chris. So, are you all engineers? Chris asks, once the handshaking has stopped. They all nod at him. Good, forgive us for being blunt, but we need to get straight down to the point. We need some sharp spikes to be made that can be embedded into the ground, Chris says. Also, we want some very small, sharp objects that can be hidden in the long grass out in the flatlands, Howie adds. You mean caltrops? Kelly asks straight away and leans forward to examine the plans on the table. Yeah, those, Howie replies, surprised at her direct manner. What about the spikes? How many and how deep are they going in? The spikes will be put into a hidden trench the width of the spit, Howie explains. We can use sharpened wooden spikes for that. Getting the material and fashioning them will be relatively easy. The hardest part will be getting them in. You'll need a lot of people for that if you want it done quickly, Kelly answers. We can get more people. That's not a problem. What about the caltrops? Right. The first problem is materials. We'll need lots of metal, but then most metals can't just be bent into shape. They might be brittle and snap. We might have to heat them and then, of course, make them sharp. That will need power tools and you'll want them over a large area, so we need lots of them. She finishes speaking, then looks expectantly at Chris, then to Howie. There's a workshop here. I'm sure we can rig some of the generators up for you, Howie replies, impressed. Can we take metal from the fittings and fixtures if we need to? One of the other engineers asks. Take what you need, do whatever you need to do, but get it done as fast as possible. We will have to put some guards with you to make sure you don't go off and tell other people what you're doing, Chris says, resting his hands on the desk and leaning forward to emphasise his point. Excuse me, one of the engineers steps forward. What was that about guards and turning other people? He's middle-aged with blonde swept-back hair. 
we cannot run the risk of anyone else knowing what our tactics are, so for now you will work alone, Chris replies. Are you telling us or asking us? The man asks politely. Listen, I'm sorry it sounds harsh, but it's the way it has to be, I'm afraid, Chris says to the man, equaling his polite tone. We were told we could come and go as we needed to, as long as we were checked when we come back in. That was then. The situation has changed, Chris says. So we can no longer come and go as we please, the man asks. No, I'm afraid not, Chris replies. Tell me, what will happen if we do? Do what, exactly? Chris asks, still maintaining his polite tone. If we try to leave, or if we try to tell other people of what we're doing? You will be stopped, Chris says curtly. How? the man asks, his cultured tones not slipping. By any means deemed necessary, Chris responds. I'm sorry, you mean that if we try to leave or speak with other people in the camp, we will be killed? The man leans forward, staring intently at Chris. If that is necessary, yes, Chris stares back. I thought this was a democracy, not a... I will stop you there, Chris interrupts pointedly. This is not a democracy, and while I understand your concerns, I can only respond by saying there is no alternative. If those things coming here find out about our plans, we will lose the best chance we have of reducing their numbers before they get to us. We do not know if anyone in the camp is infected, so we cannot run the risk of people knowing what we are doing. It really is that simple. Chris speaks calmly, looking at each of them in turn as his diplomatic skills shine through. Gentlemen and lady, of course, Chris inclines his head to Kelly. There is a huge zombie army coming for us. This is a fact. We have to do what it takes to cut their numbers before they get here. While Howie and I have the skills and knowledge and are prepared to meet them face to face, we need your skills and knowledge to try and even the sides. You are trained engineers. You have skills that we simply do not have, and we need your help. But it must be done in a controlled environment, Chris explains, looking to each of them in turn. I agree, Kelly responds immediately and with passion. We all heard what Howie said earlier, and we know the risks involved. We'll get on with it and do what we can to help. OK, I understand, but I'm a little uncomfortable with being treated like a slave or having some tyrannical despot ordering me about, the man replies directly to Kelly. The atmosphere becomes instantly charged and a silence follows his comments. Chris is clearly struggling to contain his temper and how he has to bite his own anger down. I don't understand what your concerns are, Kelly asks, slowly and clearly. My concern is being told this was a safe place and now finding out we are captives to be used as they see fit without any form for address and being told who we can and cannot talk to, the man replies. We can manage without this man. I think the rest of us understand your need for secrecy and we are happy to comply with that request. Is that so? Kelly asks the group in general. Yes, completely. I'm amazed at you, Donald. An older man with glasses responds, looking at the outspoken engineer. Well, I have the right to question their motives, Donald replies. You do, but we all know the situation, and it would appear you are happy to accept the safety of this place without undertaking any of the risks involved in keeping it safe, the older man says. And that is not the case at all, Donald responds, still maintaining a polite and calm manner. Donald... We are not on site now discussing the plans with the architect or planning officers. We are in the middle of an event of global proportions, and if we want to live, we have to accept that and deal with it, Kelly says. I do accept it, but I still maintain the right to question the methods used. This could be one step away from some kind of communist regime where we are being controlled, and I simply will not accept it, Donald replies. Chris looks to Howie with a discreet shake of his head. Howie walks to the door and over to the police office. Debbie, we've got the engineers. We've told them what we need doing, but one of them is refusing to agree not to tell anyone else, Howie says, quickly. Sergeant Hopewell looks up at him with a concerned expression, eyebrows raised. Look, 
We don't know if anyone else in the camp is infected and we cannot risk people finding out what our defence tactics are, so we're controlling the access points. I know all of this, Howie, Debbie interrupts him. I'm concerned. Detain him, Ted says firmly from the back of the office. You have to, Howie. You can't run the risk of him telling people or causing dissent, Sarah adds. How would we detain him? Howie asks. Leave it to me. There's a secure room back here that he can sit in for a few hours, Ted replies, taking a thick black belt from a hook and fixing it around his waist, handcuffs and black pouches hanging from it. He takes a police flat cap and puts it on, the peak low to his eyes, instantly transformed from genial Ted to official policeman. Where is he? Ted asks. In the planning room. I think his name is Donald, Howie answers. Lead the way, then. Ted says, with a voice full of authority. They walk quickly back to the planning room with Howie leading the way. Ted puts a hand out as they reach the door. Which one is he? Ted asks quietly. Uh, middle-aged with blonde hair sort of swept back, Howie replies. Let me go first and do the talking, understand? Ted says, not giving Howie a chance to reply as he steps into the room, pausing for dramatic effect as all eyes turn to him. Ted keeps a stern, impassive face, eyes staring out from underneath the peaked hat. He looks at each person, taking them all in. Years of experience in his manner and an aura of authority ooze off him. Ted nods and steps over to the blonde man. Sir, are you Donald? Ted asks, his eyes staring intently at the man. Yes, I am, the man replies, clearly shocked at the arrival of a fully uniformed police officer. Sir, I need you to understand what I am going to say to you. We will remain calm and we will not react in an undue manner. Is that clear? Ted says. I'm sorry, what? Donald replies. Sir, as far as we know, this fort is the last safe place in the country. We have no knowledge of any other surviving colonies or places such as this. Therefore, this fort may represent the country. Therefore, this fort also represents the concern of the nation as a whole. I am led to believe that you are causing dissent and refusing to comply with the requests being made to you. I am therefore detaining you in the interests of national security. You will come with me where you will be held in a safe place without fear of abuse or assault. What? You can't do this? Donald shouts with a horrified look on his face and quickly steps away. Ted steps forward and takes a firm grip of the man's wrist, pulling it behind his back and fixing one end of a handcuff on. Sir, this is happening. These men are doing what is necessary for the protection and survival of all of us. They and we do not have time for inconsiderate and selfish people like you. Put your other hand behind your back. Thank you. Now you will come with me and be quiet about it. Ted spins the handcuffed man around and marches him towards the door. Once outside, you will not scream or shout, and you will not cause distress or alarm to any other persons within this camp, Ted says smoothly, and with such firm authority, the man complies instantly. Ted steps through with Donald and turns back to close the door, winking at Howie as he does so. Bloody hell, Howie mutters. I'm sorry about that, Chris starts to say, but is cut off by Kelly holding her hand up. Don't be, she says. Extreme times call for extreme measures. I know he'll be looked after. It needed to be done, I'm afraid. I've met Donald on a few jobs and he's always like that. Very contrary, which normally can be dealt with. But as you say, extreme times and all that, the older man says calmly. To business. Where is this workshop? Kelly asks. Follow me. We'll find Roger and get him to lead the way, Howie replies. A few minutes later, they find Roger and follow him around the edge of the camp to the west wall and a set of large wooden double doors. Chris had found three guards from the dwindling numbers and briefed them fully, and Howie had grabbed a couple of runners and asked them to stay close. Roger opens the doors up and steps aside as the group files in. Long wooden workbenches run down the sides with old battered metal cabinets filling spaces and gaps. Hand tools are pinned to walls with the black outline of their shape etched on, showing their intended space. The smell of grease oil and coffee is in the air. The power tools are in that room at the back. It's kept locked, but the key should be in the top of that set of drawers, Roger explains, pointing to a metal filing unit in the corner. One of the engineers opens the door and pulls out a single key on a large ring. 
The rest moved slowly down the room, examining the various tools with professional interest. The rear door is unlocked, and the engineer doing the unlocking takes out a small flashlight from his pocket to illuminate the dark interior. The other engineers quickly join him, each taking out a small flashlight as they enter the dark room. Bloody engineers, always so practical, Roger jokes. Is there a generator here? A voice shouts from the back room. Yes, there's one here. We can get more for you if you need. We always had plenty of power as we're so isolated from the main power supply, Roger says, walking forward and leaning into the dark room. Well, where is it then? The voice calls out. You're the engineers, you figure it out, Roger answers with mock indignation. This is not my usual environment, he adds. Got it. Hang on, we'll get some power going, another voice calls out. A few seconds later, a deep rumbling noise comes from the back room and the darkness is dispatched with illumination from the bright strip lighting overhead. Murmurs of agreement and satisfaction reach them as the engineers mooch through the various tools and equipment. Have you seen up there, Howie? Chris asks. Howie follows his gaze to a suspended roof, adding extra storage to the room. Piles of long metal rods are stacked up in one end. Perfect. I love it when a plan comes together, Howie jokes, and he looks to see Chris staring blankly at him. What plan? Chris asks. The whole plan or just this bit? It's from the A-team, Howie says. What's the A-team? Chris asks with a puzzled expression. Well, fucking joking, right? Christ, you're worse than Dave, Howie mutters. Of course I'm bloody joking, Chris smiles. So which one am I? He asks. Hmm. I'd say Hannibal. With that beard, it's got to be B.A., Howie replies. No way. Clarence has got to be B.A., Chris responds. Yeah, fair one. Well, Dave is definitely Murdoch, Howie says. Chris chuckles. But you can't be Hannibal, as that would only leave face, and I'm not being face, Howie says firmly. What? Face was great, Chris says, shocked. In the movie or the series? Howie asks. Both, Chris replies. Well, you be face then if you like him so much. I'll be Hannibal, Howie says, as they start walking back to the planning room. No way, I can't be face. You're much better looking than me, Chris replies. You'll have to be face. I'll be Hannibal. Nope, shave your beard off and you'll make a great face, Howie says. I pity the crazy fool who tries to shave my beard, Chris growls in a deep voice as Howie bursts out laughing. I pity the crazy fool who tries to make me be face, Howie growls back as they reach the planning room door, entering to drink more coffee. What's next? Chris asks. Clarence to the fort. The radio bursts to life with Clarence's deep voice booming out. That is, I guess, Howie replies. Chris smiles as he answers the radio. Chris to Clarence, go ahead, B.A. I ain't getting on no plane. Clarence's voice booms back, making both of them laugh. Clarence to Chris, we're on way back. We'll be with you in a few minutes. Saxon to Howie or Chris, confirm we can see convoy of vehicles coming from the estate. Chris to Clarence, roger that. Hold at the gates. We'll come to you. They down the now cold coffee and head back out of the door, walking through the camp, smiling at people as they walk past or stop to stare. Ted falls in and joins them. How's our man? Howie asks Ted. He's all right. He's asking for a lawyer. So we told him your sister is a lawyer and he's trying to make a claim of unlawful arrest now, Ted smiles. Fair one, Howie replies. They arrive at the gates to find Blowers and Cookie still there, joking with each other. Lads, how are you? Howie asks. Yeah, we're good, Mr. Howie. How's the plans coming on? We've still got loads of people coming up asking if they can help, Blowers says. Slowly getting there. Seems to be taking ages, though. You two okay down here? Yeah, fine, we've got coffee on constant flow and there's a toilet in there, Cookie says, smiling. What more can a man need? Howie says. Uh, some women, some steak, no zombie army coming for us, maybe a television and an Xbox, some popcorn, Cookie replies. Oh, listen to him, women, he says. You wouldn't know what to do with one, other than sit and talk about curtains and flower arranging, Blowers cuts in. We could sit and chat with our legs folded up underneath us, wearing thick woolly jumpers, Cookie adds. What's wrong with woolly jumpers? I've got woolly jumpers, Chris interrupts with a look of serious intent. Ha, nice one, Blowers laughs. Who's laughing? Chris asks. I'm not. 
Yeah, right, you got me like this before, Blois laughs, trailing off as Chris remains poker-faced. You are joking, aren't you? Do I look like the kind of man who wears woolly jumpers? Chris replies as his face splits apart with a big grin. Well, now that you come to mention it, Blois jokes. You cheeky bugger, Chris retorts. Have some respect and get that bloody gate opened up. Clarence steps out of the armory and walks to the police office, thinking through all the items he needs to find. Hello, he says, finding Sergeant Hopewell behind the desk. Harry and Chris said to speak to you. I'm taking a foraging party out. What do you need? Gunsmiths and hardware stores, said Clarence. Hi, Clarence, Sarah smiles, walking into the office with Terry. Clarence starts to blush. Uh, hello, Sarah. He rumbles. Hello, Sarah, Sarah mimics, trying to copy his deep voice. I don't sound like that, Clarence chuckles. No, you're far worse. I'm only joking, Sarah says, putting her hand on his forearm and making him blush even more. What are you doing here? I'm taking a foraging party out. Chris and Howie need some items, he says, as a look of concern passes across her face. Are you taking many with you? Yeah, there'll be a few of us. Okay, well, you take care and make sure you come back. I still need that knife training, remember? She says. Um, okay, I will, Clarence replies, aware of Terry and Sergeant Hopewell watching them. Here you go. Here's a list and a map with them marked on, Sergeant Hopewell says, handing him some papers and a map book. Thanks. Vehicles? Do you have any? He asks. Check with Ted down at the gate. He's got all the keys. Thank you. I'll see you soon, Clarence says, turning to walk out of the room. Sarah quickly follows him out. Clarence, she says, turning him back to face her and seeing his red flushed face. You don't have to blush every time I talk to you. I can't help it, Clarence murmurs, looking down at his feet and then slowly back up at her face and her beautiful dark eyes looking at him steadily. Well, just promise me you'll come back safely, she says, looking up and holding his gaze. I will, Clarence starts to say as Sarah quickly steps in close and stretches up on her toes to kiss him on the cheek. Come back, she whispers with soft breath on his face, squeezing his arm. You'll catch flies again, she laughs. Clarence starts to walk away, his mind whirling and spinning from the kiss she gave him, still feeling the warmth on his skin and thinking he will never wash that bit of his face again. After a few steps... He realises he's forgotten to get more men and turns back towards the planning office and the groups of guards resting outside. I need a few to come out with me, Clarence says, stopping in the middle of them. They look at each other to see who will go. Two men and two women eventually step forward. Services or police? Clarence asks as they walk in a tight group towards the gate. Two of them answer services, one army, the other navy... The other two explain their police from the armed response teams, with one of them having previous military experience. They chat amiably amongst themselves as they walk to the gate, meeting Ted and arranging to take four vehicles out. Clarence rides shotgun in the first van, and the others have one vehicle each. It takes a while to sort through keys and walk down to find vans that can be taken out from the clogged-in fleet, wedged into the alley between the inner and outer wall, but eventually they're out and driving down the road and through the estate. They stop at a large, multi-chain hardware superstore on the edge of a town. The streets and villages they pass through show signs of the devastation and decay of urban life. There are burnt-out houses and rotting corpses, vehicles abandoned and left at angles and embedded into walls. Bloodstains and broken glass litter the ground. The superstore looks remarkably normal, almost surreal, like it's an early morning bank holiday. You two stay out front, you two with me, Clarence says, taking the two armed police response officers with him, knowing they will be better trained in close quarters fire and manoeuvre tactics. What do we need? The female officer asks him. Nuts, bolts, chains and anything that can be fired from a cannon. Also axes, hammers, scythes and anything that can be used as a weapon, he replies. Cannon? Are we using those old things in the fort? The male officer asks. We're going to try, Clarence says. You two go for the nuts, bolts and chains, and I'll do the weapons. Roger, the woman replies. 
The hardware store doors hang open, smashed and ruined from a previous looting. At least someone else has made the effort to gain entry and save them the time of having to do it. They find rows of trolleys inside the large entrance area and each take one and move off into the wide aisles, flanked on both sides with high shelving units. There is surprisingly little damage inside the store. Dried bloodstains and debris littered around the entrance area indicate that something happened here, but no bodies or corpses remain. Clarence looks down the ends of the rows of aisles and looks at each of the large signs. He finds the one marked hand tools and heads that way. He aims for the section with the axes and quickly starts scooping them up and placing them into the trolley. He also finds sledgehammers, pickaxes, scythes and even long-bladed machetes. Within a few minutes, the trolley is full. He wheels it outside and asks the guards to start loading before heading back in and filling the trolley with more items. He passes the two police officers heading outside with trolleys full of buckets and metal objects. They nod at one another, just like normal people mooching around the DIY store at the weekend. Loaded up, they set off away from the store. The female police officer drives the lead van, with Clarence examining the map and giving directions to the closest gunsmith. I haven't seen any zombies at all, the woman states quietly. Must be hiding. Clarence rumbles and goes back to his map reading. They keep on through the quiet rural roads, passing fields and woodland, and then head back into expensive residential areas of large, detached houses, eventually finding their way into a small market town. That's it over there, Clarence says, pointing towards the only shop that looks fortified and solid. They drive closer and find a window display of air rifles and pistols, binoculars and hunter-style clothing. Someone had a go at getting in, the woman driver says, looking at the half-smashed-in door. Despite the quaint appearance, the shop had been well secured against such raids, and the door appeared to have withstood a half-concerted effort to get in. There's blood everywhere out the front. Something happened here, Clarence says. Turn the van round and back in close to the door, he adds, getting out to examine the door closely. He walks over to the next van. Did you get any big chains? he asked. A few minutes later, and the van is revving loudly with a thick chain stretched from the tow bar back to the door handles. Now, Clarence shouts, and the van accelerates quickly, powering away from the shop. The chain springs up as the pressure pulls it, and the door is out of the frame with a loud noise of wood and metal tearing. Easy when you know how, Clarence mutters, stepping through the ragged hole and entering the small shop. Seeing rows of shotguns and rifles chained to a display cabinet behind the long counter and boxes of ammunition stacked up in a glass display case. Bingo, the ex-army man says, walking in to see the goods on display and holding a set of bolt croppers. I came prepared, the man adds, walking around the counter. He grips the thick chain in the mouth of the bolt croppers and starts squeezing, then squeezing harder until his face goes red from the exertion. May I? Clarence steps forward, taking the handles from the now sweating man. Clarence takes a handle in each hand and gives a sudden overwhelming push on each, driving the handles back together and severing the chain quickly. Yeah, well, I weakened it for you, the man jokes. And I thank you for doing so, Clarence replies, smiling, long used to the never-ending comments about his strength and size. He reaches up and starts selecting the shotguns and rifles twisting at the waist to turn and lay them on the counter. There's some good weapons here, the ex-soldier remarks, checking through the various rifles. Uh-huh, Clarence replies, distracted and thinking about Sarah, her dark hair and eyes, the way she speaks and laughs, and that kiss. Wow, that kiss, she actually kissed him. He, the massive, bald-headed freak of nature, being kissed by someone so beautiful and graceful. Clarence pauses holding the last shotgun and staring off into the middle distance. You're right, Clarence, the woman asks from behind him, making him start back to reality. Yep, never better, Clarence grins hugely to her as he turns back to the counter. So, what's her name, she adds. Her name, Clarence replies. The only thing that can make a man smile like that in the midst of all this chaos is a woman, so what's her name, she repeats. Sarah. Clarence rumbles quietly. Oh, Mr. Howie's sister, the woman says lightly. She's very pretty. She is, 
Clarence confirms, still smiling. We need bows and arrows too, he adds, remembering why they're here. They prise open the ammunition case and unload all of the boxes into plastic bags found behind the counter. One corner of the store is dedicated to archery and crossbows. There's loads here, Clarence. Do you want them all? The ex-soldier asks, examining the longbows, compound bows and dozens of packets of arrows. Yeah, get everything, Clarence replies. And the crossbows? Yes, I don't know anything about archery, so take everything. And everything is taken. The only thing they leave are the air weapons. On the basis of firing small lead pellets at a massive army of undead zombies will not have that much of an effect. Within an hour, they find the next gunsmiths. This one is located in a much bigger town and already plundered and looted extensively. Zombie corpses are everywhere. They drive on through the town, weaving past the debris until they reach a supermarket fuel station on the town exit road. Stop, Clarence calls out. The van slows to a stop, causing the following vehicles to break suddenly. Pull into the garage forecourt, Clarence instructs, staring hard to the side of the fuel station. The van turns slowly and heads into the fuel station. Look there, Clarence points to a set of large wooden gates. Good spot, Clarence, very good, the driver says admiringly, seeing the top of the fuel tanker just peeking out over the gates. Do you think it's full? Clarence asks as they get out and walk over. That's almost too much to ask for, she replies. They find the gate locked with another thick chain and padlock. Clarence turns to see the ex-soldier jogging towards them with the bolt croppers. Do you want me to weaken it for you first? The man asks lightheartedly. Clarence grunts back and snaps the chain through easily, wrenching the chain and lock off. The gates get pulled open to reveal the all-white fuel tanker. After checking it out, they're jubilant to discover it is indeed full. Does anyone know how to drive it? Clarence asks. I can. I was in the traffic department and they did my heavy goods vehicle training, the woman police officer answers. She walks in and steps up on the metal plate to open the driver's door. A body falls out on top of her, making her scream. The rest race forward to see the corpse rolling off to one side and the woman on her ass having been pushed back. Is he dead? The woman asks in shock. Dead or undead, the ex-soldier jokes, moving forward to punt the head of the corpse with his boot. The body rolls over to reveal normal human features. Dead, but normal. Nah, he's normal dead, the ex-soldier remarks. The woman police officer gets up and climbs gingerly back into the cab. Check him for keys, she says, going through the controls. Clarence bends down and quickly pats his pockets to find a set of keys and passes them up to her. She inserts the key and starts the engine. The fuel tanker rumbles to life, spewing out a cloud of black smoke which quickly dissipates. I'll take the van, you drive this behind me, Clarence shouts up. They start back to their vehicles and all stop and wince as the gears are crunched painfully behind them. They turn back to see the woman police officer sticking her middle finger up at them and laughing. After an hour of driving, they're parked up and standing around the front of a florist's window, dead and wilting flowers in the display. Well, this is the address, Clarence says, examining the map book, the list provided by Sergeant Hopewell, and then looking up at the building. That's definitely not a gunsmith, the ex-soldier remarks. Nope, must have changed it. Clarence replies. Who would turn a gunsmith's into a florist? The woman asks. Where's the next one? The male police officer asks. Never mind that, where's all the zombies gone? The ex-soldier asks nervously, looking about. They all look up and around, becoming increasingly aware of the lack of undead. I don't know. They must be massing somewhere, Clarence says quietly. You're right, though. This is eerie. A feeling of being watched descends on the group. There's one more place we can try, it's not too far, Clarence says, very aware of the uncomfortable feeling amongst them, hands gripping weapons tighter and the jokes now gone. They load back into their vehicles and drive on, again following Clarence as he handles the map on the steering wheel and works his route as he goes, treading through narrow cobbled streets and past the once boutique shops of this southern English hamlet. Clarence feels the creeping sensation growing up the back of his neck. 
There should be signs of life by now. The zombies can't all have gone. Or there are even other survivors, maybe. But then, being this close to the fort would mean those able to would have fled to them by now. Movement in the fields to his right catches his eye. A break in the hedgerow and a flash of distant colour. He slows down, but keeps moving along the country lane, constantly looking to the right and waiting for the thick hedge to end. Finally, he sees a large gate further up and slows down to take advantage of the gap. He brings the van to a stop and stares hard into the fields. What he sees is staggering. A long, thick line of people, all moving at the same speed, in the distance, across the top of the fields. The vehicles behind him stop, the drivers getting out to come forward and stare through the gate. Each of them stop and stare with shock at the thousands and thousands of zombies stretched out in a long line, moving from left to right. Which direction are they heading in? One of the policemen asks. North, Clarence replies. The main road into the area is that way. They must be going to meet the rest coming down. Fucking hell, there's thousands just there the ex-soldier says quietly. Right there for the taking, too, Clarence replies. We can't get to them, though. The vehicles will never make it across those fields, and the distance is too great for these things, Clarence adds, raising his assault rifle for effect. Where are they feeding in from? the woman asks. I don't know. Over that way, I guess. Clarence inclines his head in the direction they're moving from. The same way we're going, the woman police officer states quietly. They break away without further talk, heading back to their vehicles and moving off slowly down the lane, watching the hordes slowly move across the top of the field through the gaps in the high hedgerow. The country lane twists and turns, following the ancient hedgerow for several miles. Signposts indicate an historic town further ahead, various smaller signs urging the travellers to stop at points of interest, eat a pub lunch, rest in a picnic area, walk around some monuments or spend money on the crap punted out to unsuspecting holiday makers. Something about the signs makes Clarence think of Sarah again. In the services, he was always deployed overseas, fighting wars and battles in far-flung corners that meant nothing to him. Flown in... Briefed, trained, deployed, mission executed and moved out again. A couple of weeks rest and then another one. The various missions and countries blend into one long memory of deserts, jungles and snow-covered terrain. Inner city ghettos and months spent living out of bedsits, watching subjects from windows and building lifestyle profiles that meant nothing to him. The services and the type of work he was involved in meant he could never talk about what he did or where he had been. Over time, the connections that once existed outside the service slowly eroded until all that was left were the people he knew inside. But then, over the years, they too slowly fell away as younger, fitter and leaner men came through the ranks, and men like Clarence, Chris and Malcolm felt like dinosaurs. They left the services, but the skills they had harnessed and built simply did not transfer to civilian life. And like so many highly skilled but older soldiers... They were drawn to the world of mercenary soldiering, with the promise of action and high wages. They all said it was for the money, but in reality, it was the only way of clinging on to the life they had built, working with people who knew those same deadly skills and being able to belong to something. Former officers started security companies back in the UK and quickly contacted their former men, offering them steady wages and a dedicated role. Clarence responded to that, after years of mercenary work left a nasty taste in his mouth, shady deals done in backstreet cafes were not his idea of honour. His mammoth size and appearance meant he was perfect for door work. Often his mere presence prevented most incidents from escalating, but even then the constant hours in the seedy nightlife full of cocky idiots with gelled hair and t-shirt muscles soon wore him down. Managers and bar owners were obsessed with profit, reputation, health and safety, log sheets, toilet checks and head counts. Clarence's size, appearance and deep voice made him a target for many women. Women who loved the idea of being with a tough man with a tough reputation. But Clarence was a professional, not a steroid-addicted bouncer obsessed with image and wearing a shirt two sizes too small, and those drunken women repulsed him. He had intelligence and knowledge that just did not correlate with his appearance. 
And after years of being seen to be a big tough idiot, he accepted the type of woman he was likely to be with. But now something magical had happened. Something he had never known before. A beautiful, educated and intelligent woman was interested in him. The way she spoke to him, not patronisingly, but speaking to him as an equal, touching his arm or shoulder, leaning forward and staring into his eyes, left him almost breathless. The desperation of the world and the utter violence and degradation of mankind just in the last seven days, the hopeless feeling that no matter how they fight back or what they do, it's all pointless. Those feelings now mix with a warm, tingling feeling of something different he had not felt before. Light in the dark. A single rose amongst the weeds. Hope where there was none. Something to survive for. Something to fight for. The road sweeps around to a long, wide junction. From the left are streams of zombies pouring from the town and heading into the fields to shuffle and stagger along in dead silence. Lines of rotting, walking corpses drawn to a meeting place where they will gather and mass in readiness of war. The vehicles stop back from the junction, far enough back to be able to respond if they turn for the attack, but they don't turn. They don't pay any attention at all. We can't get through that lot without picking a fight, the woman police officer says, after jumping down and walking up to stand by Clarence. Yeah, you're probably right, Clarence replies, wishing they had the Saxon with them and the GPMG. So the motorway to the north is that way then? she asks, looking down at the map. Yeah, that must be the gathering point. The main motorway running south from London, I guess. If all these get to the various junctions feeding into it, then the main group will scoop them up as they come. Maybe they're heading somewhere else, she suggests. That, Clarence replies, is just wishful thinking. Come on, we better get back. A uh, slight problem. This is a narrow lane, and that is a big fuel truck, and I'm not reversing it all the way back. Good point. You'll be needing the junction then, Clarence says, turning back to look at the fuel truck. Yep. How will you do it? Pull out to the right, reverse back to the left, and swing back into this road, she replies quickly. Right. That's what I thought, she bites her bottom lip, staring at the constant stream heading across the junction. Well... The fuel tanker is big and heavy, and as long as you keep motion, you should be all right. And we did say we wanted to take a few of them out. Clarence rumbles quietly. No, you said you wanted to take them out. Yeah, but I can't drive that thing. Or can I? Is it hard? He asks. Yes, it's bloody hard. You'll stall the engine before you get more than a few metres. Don't worry, I'll do it. She turns and walks back to the fuel tanker, pausing as she climbs up into the cabin and looking at the junction. She nods to herself and slowly pulls out from behind Clarence's van, moving slowly up to the wide junction. Clarence watches as she seems to slow down, almost stopping. Then at the last second, the fuel tanker surges ahead, pulling over to the extreme left and brushing against the hedgerow. The tanker then pulls quickly to the right, moving out of the lane and into the junction. The front of the tanker impacts on the line of undead staggering across, striking them from behind and shunting them all forward. The collective ramming drives them into the backs of the zombies in front, acting as a giant scoop and propelling them forward. The momentum causes them either to fall out to either side or drop down onto the ground to be dragged along by the front of the truck or squashed by the massive wheels, causing blood and guts to be pumped out onto the road surface. The zombies neither slow down nor speed up, and they take no avoiding action as the truck pummels them out of the way. The fuel tanker pushes out into the right side of the junction, then breaks hard, forcing the zombies caught at the front to be propelled forward. A loud grinding of gears can be heard as the woman police officer quickly works to engage the reversing gears and start moving backwards. The rear of the truck lacks the solid wall of the front, and the zombies behind are simply crushed by the rounded edge of the tanker and the jutting out metal ladder. The tanker reverses quickly, driving backwards further down to the left until the front goes past the entrance to the lane. Once again, the tanker brakes hard and the gears crunch as she selects a forward driving gear and pulls away quickly, swinging the front around and back into the lane, ploughing through more zombies as they blindly shuffle back across the junction. As the front of the tanker draws level with Clarence, 
He steps out and applauds with respect, smiling broadly at the excellent driving skills shown. She smiles back and salutes as she drives onwards past the waiting vehicles. Clarence gets back in his van and tries to do a three-point turn in the road, but the narrow width of the lane and the length of the van make it a seven-point turn. Eventually, he succeeds and moves out of the way for the other vehicles. They move closer to the wider section of the junction to complete their manoeuvre, and within minutes, the vehicles are driving back down the lane behind the fuel tanker. Dave and Jamie move quickly to the edge of the estate, jogging in silence with fluid movements, neither showing signs of exertion. They stop at the country lane leading into the estate. The estate is here with one lane leading in, but they could use the fields on either side, Dave says, examining the area. The fields have high hedgerows, and they're thick with brambles which will be hard to push through, Jamie replies. The natural path will be this lane. We can't do anything about the fields, but we do have a choke point here. The hedges on both sides are very high, and the lane ends abruptly as it enters the estate. They will come down the lane and fan out into the estate and sweep through, but most of them will keep going straight down the centre main road, Dave explains. The first trap should be here on the central road, about halfway down. We then work back, setting more traps as we go. They will be crammed into the lane, so they will naturally spill out to the sides and move down through the estate, using all available space. So we set one here, and then more further out to the sides. That way, that will be the maximum number of them in the area when the traps go off. Jamie listens in silence and watches Dave with keen interest, tracking his view to look at the same places. Dave moves down the central road, going just past the halfway mark, looking at the parked cars nose to tail on both sides of the road. They'll come down the lane and have to go through the gap between the vehicles on either side, Dave explains. He takes two grenades from one of the canvas bags and walks back to the closest row of vehicles. Dropping down onto the ground, he positions the grenade snug against the inside of the rear tyre. Then crosses the road to place another grenade against the inside of the tyre on the opposite vehicle. When the time is right, we tie wire onto both pins and wedge them in firmly. Pressure applied to the wire pulls the pins, which activates the detonation, Dave explains, pulling a roll of very thin fishing wire from a pocket to show Jamie. Will these two be enough to detonate the rest of the vehicles? Jamie asks. In theory, yes, but there will be a delay. These grenades will detonate the fuel tanks, but we need to speed the progress up so we get maximum effect. Dave shrugs his rucksack off and takes out a container. He unscrews the lid and starts pouring a thin trail of black powder from the first grenade, working back to the next vehicle and ending the thin trail underneath the fuel tank. Dave takes another grenade and rests it in a small pool of the powder. I see, Jamie says. Dave takes out another container and hands it to Jamie. You do the other side, Dave says, and returns to move on, trailing black powder over to the next vehicle. Jamie moves across and repeats the action, pouring a thin trail of black powder from fuel tank to fuel tank and leaving a grenade nestled in the black powder underneath each one. Good, Dave says. Now we do the rest of the estate. They go back into the estate, moving from road to road and house to house, finding alleys and paths that work through the small streets. They place trip-wired grenades at various points of access, then get to the side roads connected to the central main road and stop to look at the cars and vehicles left in situ. We'll do all of these too. You do the far side, Dave says. They split up, and Jamie crosses the central lane to work the other side positioning tripwire grenades between the gaps of the vehicles and more thin trails of black powder stretched from fuel tank to fuel tank. They meet back in the central road. Now, go from house to house and turn the gas on. Close the doors to trap the gas. Got it. They move off again from dwelling to dwelling, going into kitchens and turning the gas jets on low and letting the poisonous vapour seep out to fill the rooms. They continue to work throughout the day, moving into the side streets and laying traps with grenades, wires and black powder, then going into the houses and turning the gas supply to hiss out as they move back out, closing the doors behind them. After several hours, 
They stand at the exit point of the lane where it stretches out into the flatlands and the diggers moving along, slowly churning the earth up. Clarence is still out with his foraging party. We'll wait for him to return and then put the wires across the centre path, Dave says. What about the men out front on the observation points? They won't be able to get back, though, Jamie replies. I spoke to them. I left a clear path for them to run through on the side I worked on, Dave replies. OK, Jamie nods back at him. Get our vehicle and leave it on the edge of the estate on the road. Meet me back at the entrance point, Dave says, turning to walk back up the central road. OK, Jamie replies. A few minutes later, they stand in silence at the entrance to the estate. You did well today, Dave says. Thank you, Jamie replies. Eventually, they hear engine noises coming towards them. How many? Dave asks. Engines? Uh, Jamie cocks his head and listens intently for a few seconds. I have no idea, he finally admits, feeling ashamed that he is unable to work out the different sounds of the engines. Me neither, Dave replies, and Jamie gives a rare and awkward smile. The front vehicle comes into view, Clarence's distinct bald-headed profile clear through the windscreen. The lead vehicle slows to a stop a few metres back from the entrance. Everything OK? Clarence asks, getting out and walking towards them with his assault rifle held like a toy gun in his massive hand. Yes, Dave replies. Did you rig the estate OK? Clarence asks. Waiting for you to go through so we can finish off, Dave answers. OK, mate, we've found a few things to bring back with us. We've got loads of nuts, bolts and chains for the cannon. Clarence smiles at the two quiet men. Good. Is that a fuel tanker? Dave asks, looking over at the large vehicle with the engine idling. Yep, and it's full too. Thought we might make use of it. Dave nods, staring at the tanker. If they don't need it down there, we can use it here. Roger, I'll pass that on, Clarence replies. Let them know the estate is rigged and to be avoided, Dave adds, as Clarence walks back to the vehicle. The convoy stops on the single track road leading to the fort as Howie and Chris step out of the gates, accompanied by Blowers and Cookie. All of them look at the fuel tanker. Where on earth did you find that? Chris calls out as they walk towards each other. Clarence turns to glance at the fuel tanker. We found it behind some gates next to a petrol station. Couldn't believe it was still there. We've got loads of stuff from the hardware store and the first gunsmiths, but the next one was looted. The one after that was a florist's and not much use. A florist's? Howie interrupts. Who would turn a gunsmith into a florist's? That's what we said. So then we went for the last one and saw shitloads of zombies marching out of a town heading north. North? Chris asks quickly, all of them focusing hard on Clarence's words. Yeah. Looks like they're going towards the motorway, but moving as the crow flies, going across land and fields. How many? Howie asks. Thousands. Just a solid line of them. They're moving slowly and they didn't pay us any attention, not even when we mowed a few down with the fuel tanker. You reckon they're heading for the motorway? Chris asks. Must be. It makes the most sense. They get to the junctions on the motorway and then tag onto the main bulk as they pass through. The most obvious theory is that they're massing just like they did in London, Clarence says, looking to Chris, then Howie. Well, we knew it was coming. This is just a dose of reality, Howie says grimly. It changes nothing. We've got spotters out and Dave is rigging the estate now. He's done it. Him and that other quiet one, Clarence says. Jamie, they've done it already, Howie replies. He wants the fuel tanker up there if you don't need it. I bet he bloody does. I bet his eyes lit up at that thing, Howie laughs. Is it full? With petrol, Clarence nods. The last point of defence before they get to us is the deep ditch after the last bank. If we pour petrol in, we'll lose loads being soaked into the ground before it starts to fill, Howie muses. I see what you mean, Howie. Some pipes filled with petrol spraying out, maybe? Chris adds, rubbing his beard as he thinks. Flamethrowers? Howie asks. Big fucking flamethrowers, now that would be cool, Chris smiles. But it'll take too long to sort out. Maybe not, Ted interrupts. We've got plenty of plumbers here. Let me have a word with them and see what we can do. 
You happy with that, Howie? Chris asks, looking at him. Yeah, we've got no choice, really. We know they're massing or getting ready, so we need to pick the pace up. It's already getting late. Chris, find out how the diggers are getting on, then how long before we can start putting the spikes and caltrops in. We need Dave back here to sort those cannon out and see if they can be used. Ted, find those plumbers and work out if we can rig something up with the petrol going through pipes in the ditch. Clarence, you take the weapons and materials you found to Malcolm and then get the lists of people that have weapons experience and start drilling or training or distributing the weapons. Use the top of the inner wall for the long-range weapons and get people up there ready. There's some archers here too. Find out where they need to be positioned. Ideally, we want them on the top of the inner wall too, firing high so they get the best range. Blowers and Cookie, stay on that gate and do not let anyone out that shouldn't be going out. Got it? Howie speaks firmly and quickly, looking to each man as he issues orders and instructions. They nod back at each request. Good. We need to move and get this done quickly. Let's go. The afternoon rolls on, with the long hours flying by as those few men tasked with the responsibility work like demons without rest. Strong coffee, adrenaline and the knowledge of what's coming their way keep them working at a pace that would leave most reeling from exhaustion. Chris stalks the fort, radio in hand, speaking to the guards with the digger drivers, urging them to move quickly and finding out the pits are nearly finished. He locates Sergeant Hopewell in the office, already surrounded by people clamouring for her attention. Chris pushes through, using his bulk to force a path, and then instructs Sergeant Hopewell to find people to send out and cut weeds and long grass down, and be ready to assist the engineers. Then he works his way to the workshops to find Kelly and the rest hard at work and more people already drafted in to sort wooden shafts, posts and metal poles into piles that are waiting to be sharpened into spikes or to be cut and bent into the deadly foot traps. Several generators sourced from non-essential parts of the fort chug and roar as the power tools scream out. Sparks from metal cutters cascade out onto the workshop floor and every space is dominated by small groups hard at work. Chris pauses at the door, watching Kelly move from group to group, correcting and offering advice. Kelly, how's it going? Chris asks, finally getting her attention. Good. The spikes are almost ready. They were the easiest. The foot traps are taking a bit longer, though, she replies, wiping sweat from her brow with an old cloth and smearing black grease over her forehead. Can we start getting them in, then? The spikes? Uh, yeah, I think we can. Good. Find someone to send out to supervise it if you can't be spared, Chris replies firmly. No, I'll go myself. Are there guards out there? she asks. Several of them. No one is to go near the edge of the estate. The guards will shoot them if they do. Get out there as quick as possible, Chris responds, and walks out of the room. Back on the radio, he informs the gate that engineers will be coming through shortly, and then talks to the guards with the digger drivers. He tells them to get the pits finished and then use the drivers to help with whatever else is needed. Finally, he establishes that Dave is on his way back to the fort with Jamie. Ted moves away from the small gathering outside the fort, moving quickly and with purpose back inside. He walks quickly to the police office to find Sarah and Terry helping Sergeant Hopewell deal with the many inquiries. People now coming in to ask questions about all the activity taking place and trying to find more people to help the engineers. Ted finds the stack of lists and works his way through the pile until he finds names of plumbers and the sections within the camp they are allocated to. Striding back outside, he looks for runners to send out, only to find the supply of runners now exhausted. Where are all the runners? he calls out, stepping back into the office and having to shout over the clamour of voices. All busy, Ted, Sarah replies. Ted steps back out and casts his experienced eye around to see Tom and Stephen strolling along in the camp still bickering. You two, come here, Ted bellows. Tom and Stephen both spin around, recognising his voice instantly, and move quickly over to him. We need plumbers. They're on these lists, Ted starts to explain. Have we sprung a leak? Stephen jokes. Shut up and focus, young man, Ted snaps at him, and notices they both visibly straighten up at the tone of his voice. 
Take these. Ted hands the lists to Stephen. Get them over to me as soon as possible. And I mean as soon as possible. Okay, Ted. Right, Tom, Ted gave me the lists, so I'll be in charge of this project, seeing as Mr Howie said we're both the same now. Stephen starts to gloat. I said now, Ted booms at them. They both turn quickly and start heading back into the camp as Ted heads back towards the police office with a wry smile and a shake of his head. As the small gathering listens to Howie, Clarence watches him closely. This untrained man, a supermarket manager, gives orders to trained and experienced soldiers. There's something about him, though, the passion he exudes and the absolute certainty with which he speaks. Even Big Chris defers to Howie, and Clarence thinks back to the many missions when Chris was in charge. But Chris was always a man's soldier, never an officer. Howie is like an officer, the type of officer the men all respect and trust, the officer always leading from the front, the officer that can see all the facets of the mission, not just the one bit he is doing. Clarence had met great strategists in his time, but none of them had the human touch that Howie possesses. His ability to look a man in the eye and say with certainty that this needs to be done and it needs to be done now. Clarence watches Big Chris and the way he listens to Howie. Chris had always been that rare thing in a soldier, a good diplomat as well as a good fighter. However, Chris had never taken to idiot officers very well and had been outspoken if he felt they were doing the wrong thing, often to the detriment of his own career. Clarence breaks away and heads back to his vehicle. Blowers and Cookie drag the big vehicle gates open, then pull the huge gates of the inner wall open too, allowing the vehicles to be driven inside the safety of the fort. The fuel tanker is directed into the gap between the walls. The other vehicles, headed by Clarence, drive slowly through the compound to the armory and over to Malcolm waiting outside. Big man, did you get anything nice for me? Malcolm greets his long-time comrade with a massive smile and a warm handshake. Well, we got a few bits. Rifles, shotguns and loads of ammunition. First time I've loaded up with bows and arrows, though, Clarence replies, going around to the back and opening the rear doors. Strange times, my friend, Malcolm muses as he starts going through the various items. What the bloody hell are we going to do with shotguns? Yeah, I know, but Chris and Howie said to get everything, Clarence says. I suppose they'll be usable if they breach the walls and get inside. We'll use them for defence only. Some of these rifles are good, Clarence. I suppose so, but a few dozen heavy calibre general purpose assault rifles would be better. Ha! And if we were in America, we'd be able to pick them up in a supermarket too. Fuck me, those blokes had some decent ordnance. Malcolm reminisces back to conflicts he had fought alongside the US Marine Corps and their never-ending supply of decent weapons. I bet there's some secure places over there. The ex-soldier that went with Clarence interrupts as he helps them to unload the vans and carry the items into the large armoury room. Mate, I don't know your name, Clarence suddenly realises as the ex-soldier walks by the side of him with arm loads of shotguns. Brian, nice to meet you. Brian grunts as he lifts a heavy load onto a workbench. You too. Listen, I'll have to leave you to it. I've got some tasks to finish. Clarence says, walking back out of the armory and up to the police office. He enters to find the inside even more frantic, radios blaring out with chatter, people talking loudly, and Sergeant Hopewell trying to do a hundred things at the same time. Clarence frowns as he looks at the bedlam in front of him, trying to figure out the best way of getting her attention without simply pushing everyone else out of the way. A cool hand touches his arm, and he glances down to see Sarah smiling broadly at him her clean white teeth framed by those soft pink lips. You're back, she says simply. I said I would be, Clarence replies. I'm glad. I was getting worried, Sarah says. Clarence doesn't reply, but stares for long seconds, losing himself in her dark eyes. He gently puts his hand over hers, his giant mitt dwarfing her small, delicate hand. A tingling sensation prickles through him from the contact, a simple action yet so endearing that she steps forward involuntarily until they are standing with bodies touching. In the chaos of the office, with voices shouting and people surging around them, 
they stand staring into each other's eyes and slowly move forward until their lips are but a tiny distance apart. Did you need something, mate? Ted's voice snaps them back to reality as he bustles into the office and heads over to the stacks of paper on the desk. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I think so, Clarence stammers, feeling a strange sense of loss at being so close to kissing her. You think so? Ted asks with a puzzled frown. I'll see you in a while. I'm glad you're back. Come and find me if you get any spare time. Sarah says quietly and slips away, back into the furore going on around them. Sorry, Ted, I need lists of anyone with weapons training or experience, and the archers, too. Yep, okay. How are you going to do it? Ted replies, starting to leaf through a big pile of papers. Can you get them all down to the front, near the gates? Clarence asks. It'll take a bit of time, Clarence. It's bedlam here, as you can see, and we've got no runners left, Ted replies. The Saxons got a loud hailer. Use the radio and get one of them to put it out so everyone can hear it, Clarence says. Good idea. Now why didn't I think of that? Ted mutters as he hunts round for the radio. Police office to the Saxon, Ted speaks into it. Saxon to police office, go ahead. Police office to Saxon, can you use the loudspeaker and ask the people that registered their firearms experience to report to the front of the fort? Roger, confirm you want anyone with firearms experience to report to the front. Answer, yes. Also, anyone with archery experience. Roger that. We'll do it now. Thanks, Ted. Clarence rumbles in his deep voice. He walks out of the office and down to the armory, reaching the door as the amplified voice of Nick Hewitt suddenly fills the air. Nick's loud message creates a general buzz and a sense of excitement within the camp. People start moving about quickly, talking loudly. Those people with weapons knowledge find their families or partners and hastily kiss and hold them before heading off with grim faces, meeting others along the way and walking together while talking. Clarence enters the armory to see Malcolm, Brian and a few others still bringing in the items from the vehicles. I'm going down the front to start sorting out the people with weapons knowledge, Clarence informs them. Do you need a hand, mate? Brian says. I did an instructor course a few years back. Definitely. Malk, can you spare Brian? Yep, crack on. We've got enough people here. You bring them back here for weapons allocation, Malcolm asks. Yeah, I'll take a few with me, and can you send more down as soon as you get the chance? Roger, give me a few minutes to see what I've got, Malcolm replies. Bloody quartermasters. All the same, Clarence jokes as he leaves. Cookie and blowers disperse from the briefing now long used to the sudden, ferocious intensity of Howie. They both listen with awe as he gives clear instructions to the rest, giving them tasks, but leaving it to them how they get it completed. They then stroll back and open the gates wide to allow Clarence and the rest of the vehicles to get through into the fort. The gates are closed after them, and they once again resume their static guard on the front walkthrough gate, watching as the men dart about with a renewed sense of pace and urgency. Kind of feels weird standing here while everyone else is running about, Cookie remarks after a few minutes. Yeah, I know what you mean, but Nick and Curtis are doing the same up top with the Saxon, Blowers says. What about Tucker? Where's he? Cookie asks. Mr Howie asked him to sort out the food situation. He'll be in his element then, Cookie says. I expect so. Talking to which I'm bloody starving, Blowers says. Aye, me too, Cookie replies. I? Blowers asks, picking him up on the strange comment. What? You said I. Yeah, and? Nothing. What? Cookie asks. No, mate, nothing. It's just that sailors say I. Oh, for fuck's sake, Blowers, don't start. What? I never said anything. You can be a sailor if you like. Why would I want to be a sailor? Cookie asks. So you can say I. And of course there's all the seamen. Oh, fuck off. You like seamen, don't you, Cookie? Piss off, blowers! They eventually stop talking and lean back against the gate to rest. Did you hear what Clarence said about them heading north? Cookie says. Yes, mate. There's going to be fucking shitloads of them coming for us. Yeah. Did it bother you? Cookie asks quietly. I don't know. If I think about it, then yeah. Yeah, I guess it does. 
But I keep thinking of the other scraps we've had and we've done all right so far, Blowers replies. It's going to be a lot more this time, Cookie says. How could it be worse than London? There were thousands of them then, and besides, they can't all attack at the same time, can they? Eh? Well, like in London, we formed a circle, and it's only the first row that could actually attack us. The rest just waited and stepped in when the first lot got knocked down. Yeah, but we ain't going to be in a circle this time, are we? We're going to be stood in a big line. Yeah, but it's still only the first row that can actually attack us. The others are behind them. I see what you mean. I'm sort of anxious about it. A bit scared and also kind of looking forward to it, like I want it to happen, Cookie says plainly. Blowers glances over at his friend, speaking from the heart. Do you know what I mean, Blowers? I'm scared and terrified, but also excited and ready for it, all at the same time, Cookie repeats. I know what you mean, mate. I feel the same. I think we all do. Otherwise, we'd have bottled long before now. That was a bit deep for you, Blowers. You like it deep. Oh, for fuck's sake. We tie the wire onto the pin like this. Then we have to make sure the grenade is firmly placed. Otherwise, the pressure on the wire will simply pull the grenade along the ground and not pull the pin out. Then we feed the wire over to the other side and position the second grenade, making sure the wire is taut. Dave gently pulls the wire until it stretches across the road. Then we tie it off and again make sure the grenade is firmly placed. Got it? Got it, Jamie replies. They step back and move a few feet away. Already the thin fishing wire is hard to see. Nodding with satisfaction, they move back down through the estate, heading towards the vehicle they left on the road to the fort. Where will we put the tanker if we get it? Jamie asks. Either in the middle, so we get the full effect of the blast and the shrapnel it creates, or closer to the exit onto the fort road. OK. The inside of the car is uncomfortably hot with warm, stale air. They both wind their windows down quickly as Jamie pulls away, driving towards the fort. The ditches on both sides are almost finished, with the diggers now working at the far ends, the freshly churned brown earth looking stark against the green flat lands. People from the fort walk out over the flatlands carrying hand tools and heading towards the big patches of long grass. Clarence and one of the guards from the commune stand in front of the fort talking to a large group of people, each of them holding a collection of rifles. A large group of archers are placed off to one side, some of them holding great bows the size of a man, others with smaller modern bows with pulleys and contraptions attached to them. They stand talking pointing out to the flatlands and then back up at the walls behind them. Others in the group sort through the large boxes and packets of arrows. Dave turns back to take in the diggers and the men working with them, then back at the rows of workers coming from the fort towards the long grass. Clarence speaking to the large groups and showing them the weapons, the archers making ready. Now more people are filing out from the gates carrying long, sharpened spikes and loading them into the backs of vehicles waiting nearby. Dave recognises the engineers carrying buckets of small, sharp, twisted metal foot traps and loading them into the vehicles. Jamie stops the car near the front. They climb out and Dave walks straight over to Howie. Mr Howie, Dave says. Dave, Howie greets him back with a genuine smile. How did you get on? Good, the estate is all set. Is Jamie okay? Very good, Mr Howie, very capable. Takes after you, mate. They must be the spikes for the ditches. Yep, they've worked bloody hard getting them done so quickly. Just got to get them driven in now. We've had to get a lot more people involved, which I didn't want to do, but we don't really have a choice if we want all these things to happen. The first load of caltrops are ready too. Clarence and that chap. Uh, Brian have got the lists of all the people with weapons experience and they're checking to make sure they won't shoot themselves in the foot or someone else for that matter. Then we've got the archers over there. Clarence found some good supplies and some of them had their own kit with them. I don't know if they'll be any good but it gives them hope and something to do. You've got a lot done, Dave remarks. Yes we have, Howie admits. Ted is rounding up some plumbers too. We'll find out if we can rig some pipes up in the deep ditch after the last bank for flamethrowers. Is that for the fuel tanker? Dave asks. Yes, 
Well, the petrol from the fuel tanker, anyway. I heard you had plans for the tanker. You can have the fuel first. I just want the vehicle. Don't you need fuel in it to make this blow up? Howie asks. No, the fumes trapped inside the pressurised container will be enough. Oh, so we can use all the fuel, then? Well, maybe just leave a little bit in there, if that's OK, Mr Howie. No worries, mate. I don't know if the flame-throwing idea will work. Surely we'll need to store the fuel, then pump it into the pipes, and then if we put holes in the pipes for the flames to come out of, won't the fuel just leak out? Also, how does it get ignited? And wouldn't the flame just shoot back inside the pipe and blow the whole thing up? Yes, yes, yes and yes. And you would need ignition from a distance, otherwise the person doing the igniting would get blown up, and yes, it would all blow up, Dave replies. Oh, I see, Howie says with a frown. But. You could just lay hoses down in the ditch and fill them with petrol. Put containers or buckets and other things filled with fuel, grenades, bits of metal, nails, screws, anything sharp, and ignite it from a distance. The whole thing will go then, and the steep sides of the ditch will force the pressure wave and explosion straight up and not out to the sides. Bloody hell, Dave. You really like blowing things up, don't you? Yes, Mr Howie, Dave replies flatly. We'll do that then. How about the cannon? Do you think you can get them working? They already work. It's just a matter of knowing how they work, having the right mix of powder, charge, and then what we use to fire at them. I'll start looking at them now. I'll get some coffee up to you, Howie says. Okay, thanks, Mr Howie. Dave heads into the fort and finds Jamie talking with Cookie and Blowers. What's next? Jamie asks him. Cannon, Dave replies. Like two peas in the pod, them two. Blower's remarks as they watch Dave and Jamie walk off towards the steps. Howie stands watching the activity unfolding in front of him, a deep look of concentration on his face. So far, so good, he thinks, but the news of the zombies leading across the fields leave his mind unsettled. Howie knows the reality of the situation, probably better than anyone else other than Dave but for one of them to actually have seen them preparing brings it home. Two armies, one vastly outnumbering the other, getting ready to meet. He turns and heads back towards the fort, deep in thought. Cookie and Blowers both remain quiet and let him pass without interruption. The noise of the camp fills the air. The recent movement of people going outside to help with spikes, caltrops, cutting grass, weapons training and archery have rapidly increased the air of excitement and charged the atmosphere. Howie watches people moving quickly between sections. He notices that many of them are now armed with whatever they can find. Sticks, metal poles, knives, hand axes and hammers. The change is palpable and positive. The charged atmosphere has rubbed off on everyone, and for the first time, Howie takes note of the children in the camp. Small children are running between the tents, chasing each other and laughing. Bigger boys walk in groups and hold small sticks in their hands, ready to fight and kill all the zombies. Howie notices the traditional roles of male and female have suddenly come back. The boys are carrying the weapons, and the girls are working with the women to prepare food and clean the area and helping to feed babies. The sound of children's laughter fills his ears, and the gleeful, uncorrupted sound is like music. Their innocence and utter faith that these adults will protect them from everything touches him deeply. The resilience of their young minds that have almost certainly faced untold horrors already, but here they are, running and playing like children have always done. The thought of the undead army sweeping through them and getting into the fort to savage these children fills Howie with a sickening feeling, and a thought process quickly enters his head. There's a problem here. If they do get in, and there is every chance they will, then these children have nowhere to go. The mothers will fight like tigers. Of that there is no doubt, but they too will fall. They must be protected. At all costs, they must be made safe and kept safe. Without them, there is no purpose for all of this. We can stand and fight and show them how brave we are, Howie thinks. But for what reason? To give ourselves freedom to live so our race can continue. The thought of there now being two races of people on the earth hits Howie hard. 
an evil race intent on killing every last human and those small humans who are now running about and playing and must survive in order to make more humans. There is nowhere else to run, though. Beyond that wall is the sea. There aren't enough boats to take them all away and nowhere to go if they did find enough. But maybe, just maybe. Howie makes his way quickly through the camp, his mind whirling. Why did he leave this so late? He reaches the police office and is stunned for a second to see the almighty clamour going on. People are shouting and pushing forward to speak to a very harassed-looking Sergeant Hopewell and Terry. Sarah, Terry, I need to speak with you both now. Howie speaks firmly and his voice cuts across the room as the people realise Mr Howie is here. The three of them step outside and move away from the door to a quiet spot. Listen, I don't know why I didn't think of this sooner, but we are right on the sea here, so there must be harbours or mooring points round here. I want you to find boats and get them back here. Why? What for? Sarah asks quickly. When they come, I want the children loaded onto boats and moved out and away from the fort. If they get in, we'll all be killed. We must do whatever we can to keep them safe. Find some people that can handle boats and navigation and have them ready to report to a set place when the action starts. Get the mothers too. Be ready to get them out, Howie says intensely. Good idea, very good idea, Sarah replies, nodding her head. There is one boat out there already. I saw it when we arrived, Terry says. Good. Get them to use that to go out and find more and bring them back. Work out how many children and mothers we have and make sure they bring enough back with them. Uh, this is a horrible question, Howie. But what age child do we go up to? Sixteen? Eighteen? Eighteen. They'll be old enough to offer some protection and care for the younger ones. Some of the 18-year-olds won't want to go, Terry says. They'll want to stay and fight with their fathers and brothers. That's natural, but just do what you can. It's already getting late, so do it quickly, and I will want to speak to the boat people before they go. Send them to the planning office. Breaking apart to move off to their respective offices, they each feel the sense of pace increasing, knowing that with each passing hour, the zombie army build in numbers and draw ever closer. Terry rushes into the office, ignoring the people moving towards her with questions. She pulls the stacks of lists from the desk and moves down to Sarah at the back of the office, purposefully putting her back to the rest of the room. How do we do this? Terry asks, scanning through the lists of skills. I don't know if we even recorded people with boat skills. She glances back to see Sergeant Hopewell still frantically struggling to cope at the main desk. Sarge! Did we record people with boating skills? Terry shouts across and gets a quick glance from Sergeant Hopewell before she returns to dealing with the people in front of her. It's here, under occupations, Sarah says. We've got Royal Navy sailors and commercial sailors in the camp. I guess being this close to the coast, there would be. Let me see, Terry asks, leafing through the papers. There's a Royal Navy Reserves captain here, Henry Marshall. He's retired and getting on a bit in age but we recorded him having commercial experience too. Let's find him. Sarah stands up, ready to go. Hang on, let me check something. Yes, he's also on the list of people with weapons experience. He'll be down with Clarence at the front. Clarence has a radio. Can we call him and get him sent back? Sarah asks. Terry fights back through the crowds at the desk to reach the radio, then pushes back out to find some clear ground. Police officer Clarence. Clarence to police officer, go ahead. Police officer Clarence, have you got a Henry Marshall with you? Confirm Henry Marshall. Stand by. Answer, yes, Henry Marshall. A few minutes go by, with Sarah and Terry staring intently at the radio. Clarence to police office. Yes, we have Henry Marshall with us. Police officer Clarence, send him back to us immediately. His services are required urgently. Clarence to police office. Roger that. He's on his way to the police office. Police officer Clarence, thank you and out. Good. Now, I don't know about you, but I need a coffee, Sarah says, heading to the back room and the kettle that has been running non-stop for several hours. Howie moves back into the planning office after leaving Terry and Sarah. Big Chris is inside with several men, all looking over the plans on the table. 
Yes, these are the ditches here. We want pipes running with fuel that we can ignite from a distance and create a wall of flame, Chris explains to the men. Cancel that, Chris. Change of plan, Howie says quickly, then runs through the idea given by Dave. Much better, Chris nods back. Sorry, you must be the plumbers, seeing as most of you have pencils behind your ears. I'm Howie, Howie says, smiling and shaking hands with them in turn. Howie, leave this with me. I'll take these chaps down and get started, Chris says, quickly leading the men outside. Howie pauses for a second in the sudden quietness of the room. The noise from the camp reduced as Chris closes the door behind him. Rubbing his hands through his hair, he walks around the desk to the large flask and presses his hand against the side. Still warm, he finds a half-filled cup and moves back over to the door and throws the cold, empty contents out onto the ground. He then closes the door and moves back inside. He takes a teaspoon and loads it up with sugar from a ragged bag left on the table, then pours the hot black coffee into the mug. The aroma hits him instantly, and the simple act of making a coffee calms him immeasurably. Mug in hand, he feels his body relaxing for the first time in days. Staring into nothingness, he raises the mug slowly to his lips and takes the first mouthful, just as the door pops open with Terry leaning in. Howie, this is Henry Marshall, retired Navy captain. Mr Marshall, this is Howie. Terry moves back and closes the door after a small-built man with white hair and a white beard enters. Mr. Howie, good to meet you, sir. The man moves forward as Howie scrabbles up from his now seated position to shake his hand. Mr. Marshall, thank you for coming. Please take a seat, Howie offers. Please, Henry is fine, the man replies, smiling and taking a seat opposite Howie. Okay, and I'm just Howie. Everyone seems to be calling me Mr. Howie lately. Comes with the job, young man. People like to know who is in charge, Henry smiles warmly, his voice rich with a deep baritone. Forgive me firing questions at you. Has anyone said why you're here? Howie asks. Not yet. I was with the others going through weapons drill when they said to come here. Okay, may I ask, what's your experience with ships and boats? Howie asks. Well, where do I start, young man? Henry smiles. I was a commercial skipper on cargo ships, fuel tankers, then did a stint in the cruise liners, and I was also captain in the Royal Navy Reserves. I've been around boats and ships all of my life. Do you know these waters very well? Howie asks. Like the back of my hand, young man. May I ask why? Sir, as you know... There is a huge army of those things coming for us. We've got lots of children here, and we have to do what we can to protect them. I was thinking of this when I first got here. Yes, it is an option, and yes, there are several small harbours around here that would have numerous pleasure craft moored up. Could you take the small boat that's out the back and bring more boats back? Enough for the children and their mothers? I can try. We'll definitely get some back. Whether there's enough is a different matter. And do we know how long we've got? We know they're massing now a few miles out, so it could be any time. The night would be the best time for them to attack, as they become faster. But they've been changing so much in the last few days that anything is possible, Howie explains. Right, we'd best get moving then. I'll need some people with me. I know a few here that will be suitable to take with me. Speak to Terry and Sarah next door. They'll help you find them. One more thing. Do you have a safe destination to take them all? Howie asks. There's two places. Across the water to the Isle of Wight, or to one of the forts in the sea, Henry replies. Henry, this is absolutely vital. Do not tell anyone else where you plan to take them. Not one other person must know. If those things find out where you are going, they will hunt you down and kill you all. I cannot make that clear enough, Howie presses on the older man. Yes, of course, Henry says, looking Howie in the eye. Now, please hurry and be as quick as you can, Howie says, standing up. Henry follows his lead and extends his hand to Howie. I won't let you down, Henry says firmly before leaving the room. 
Howie sinks back down on his chair, raises his feet to rest on the desk, and once more takes a sip of his coffee. Typical, it's gone cold, Howie mutters, staring down at the inky black liquid slushing in the cup. His brow furrows as he thinks of something he was meant to do. Something with coffee. Shit! Dave! These rooms are very secure, Roger explains to Dave as he unlocks the solid metal padlock before inserting keys to the several locks on the door. They're alarmed too, Roger adds as he pushes the door open to hear a loud, urgent bleeping sound. He moves over to an alarm panel and keys in a number of digits. That's better. Now, do you know what you need? Roger asks. Dave steps into the room to look at the wrought iron fence bolted across the width of the room and the small gate set into it. That's locked too. Now let me see. It must be one of these. Roger thumbs the keys on the big loop, trying several until, with a satisfying click, the gate swings open. Entering the cage, Dave heads straight to the rear. Powder bags are already made up and stacked carefully on shelves above the ground. There are large signs telling people not to smoke. Is this where you got the powder from earlier? Dave asks. Yes, David. There are containers on the shelving unit that I think they use for the muskets, Roger answers as Dave winces at the use of his full name. It's Dave. I need all of these powder bags to be brought up, plus all of that wadding, and I need lots of water and all of those ramrods, Dave says, pointing to each item in turn. Anything else? Roger asks. Yes. All of the black powder that's here and the empty powder bags too. Get them all up to the top and leave them by the Saxon. Dave turns and leaves, walking straight out of the door without another word and leaving Roger standing, bemused. Dave walks across the compound and through the camp, ignoring everyone else, his mind entirely on the task at hand. Reaching the armory, he enters to find Malcolm still sorting the weapons and ammunition. I need all of the cannon ammunition. Dave says flatly. Hello, Dave. How are you? Malcolm asks, irritated by his instant demand. I'm fine. Where is the cannon ammunition? Dave answers, not registering Malcolm's tone. We've got buckets of the stuff. Tons of it. Clarence got a load on his forage and we went round to find more stuff. Where is it? We moved it all into one of the back rooms. Why? Because it was taking up so much bloody space, that's why. Malcolm snaps back. I need it all up top, Dave says, still devoid of emotion. Right, you need it up top. Okay, well, let's drop everything and get that done for you. Is there anything else we can do while we're here? Malcolm says sarcastically. No, just that. Thank you, Dave replies and leaves the room to head back up to the top of the north wall. Fucking special forces, always the fucking same, Malcolm mutters. He heads outside to find one of the guards and instructs him to go into the police office and find people to form a chain to pass the cannon ammunition up to the south wall. The guard nods and strolls into the police room to join the queue of people already waiting for Sergeant Hopewell's attention. Thinking that his request is probably more urgent, he gently pushes through the throng until he reaches the desk and stands, dominating the view of the harassed sergeant. We need a chain of people to pass items up to the top of the north wall, the guard says simply. How the hell am I supposed to do that? Sergeant Hopewell snaps angrily. You've got a mouth. Go and find people yourself. Why can't you do it? The guard asks defensively. Because I'm bloody busy, that's why. Sergeant Hopewell shouts, ignoring the man and turning back to the person she was talking to before. The guard pushes back away from the desk and heads further into the room to see Sarah and Terry examining sheets of paper and talking quietly. We need a chain of people to pass items up to the top of the north wall, the guard repeats. And I need more coffee and some sleep and a bloody computer would help rather than working in the dark ages with sheets of bloody paper, Terry retorts. Yeah, but this is important, the guard says, looking with distaste at the stacks of paper. Important, is it? Because what we're doing clearly isn't important then, Terry shouts at the guard before going back to speaking with Sarah. After a few minutes, the guard coughs and interrupts. So, can you get the people or not? He asks. No, we bloody can't. We've got no runners left and a million other things to do. Yeah, but do not, yeah, but me. Find someone else, Terry snaps, turning her back on the man. 
The guard walks away from the office, scratching his head. He walks back into the armory and finds Malcolm putting piles of shotguns together. That was quick. Are they ready? Malcolm asks. No, I couldn't find anyone, the guard announces. Fucking what? Malcolm shouts. There's 7,000 people out there sitting around doing nothing. I asked in the police office, but they were too busy, the guard starts to explain. Too busy? Doing what, may I ask? Filing missing persons reports for the 40 million fucking zombies roaming around eating fucking brains? Get out there and find some people to get that shit up to the south wall, Malcolm roars at the poor man. He turns once again and heads back outside. A lifetime of infantry experience in the army taught him he is the lowest on the food chain, and to argue would most likely either invoke a beating or cleaning the toilets for the next month, or probably both. He stands staring at the impenetrable mass of people in the camp. His lack of creative flair or ability to think outside of orders stumps him. Scratching his head, he wanders through the camp, looking for someone to ask, but they all look so busy, talking, flitting between the tents, or moving quickly between places. His wandering brings him close to the front gate, where Cookie and Blowers are still leaning and drinking coffee. What's up, mate? Blowers asks, seeing the lost look on the bewildered guard's face. They need a chain of people to get the cannon ammunition up to the top of the north wall. I asked in the police office and they told me to piss off. I went back to Malcolm and he told me to piss off. Now I don't know who to ask, the man explains. Ah, that's easy. Me and Cookie will get it sorted, Blur says, relieved at the prospect of being away from his position. Yeah, definitely. Are you sure? The guard asks, sensing a sudden light at the end of the tunnel. Standing guard duty is easy compared to having to actually speak to people. Yeah, of course. Now, no one goes in or out without checking with Mr. Howie or Chris first. Got it? Blowers asks. Got it, the man responds, happily taking up position by the side of the gate. Blowers and Cookie walk away, stretching and feeling pleasure at being able to walk about for the first time in hours. They walk over to the armory to find Malcolm still wound up and muttering to himself. Hi, Malk, that guard said you needed people to carry some stuff. Blowers asks. Didn't he do it? Bloody people can't just get things done, can they? Malcolm starts off. Blowers quickly holds his hands up. No worries, mate. We'll get it sorted. Where is it? All of that stuff in the back room. Malcolm points to the door at the rear. Got it. Leave it with us. We still got the radio cookie? Get hold of Nick and ask him to do one of his supermarket announcements again. Blowers says as they move back outside. Cookie speaks into the radio, telling Nick what he needs. Listen to this, Cookie says, smiling at Blowers. Attention, please. Attention, please. Clean up on aisle eight. Nick's voice booms out over the camp as Cookie and Blowers both burst out laughing. Attention, please. We need volunteers to form a chain from the south wall to the north wall. Please report to the two ugly-looking men in uniform. The camp freezes at the announcement, some of the people smiling and laughing at the comments, some clearly not understanding. Within minutes, Blowers and Cookie have a long chain of people stretching from the armory, going through the camp and up to the vehicle ramp onto the north wall. More people than they need join in, but the action of doing something, anything, propels them to try and join in, and the line quickly becomes overcrowded. Cookie, get Nick to ask him to separate into two lines, Blowers calls out. Attention, please. Attention, please. There are too many people in the line. Can we have all the men in one line and all the women in another line? Come on, men versus women. Let's see who can get their load done first. Nick carries on, urging the camp into two lines until, after a few minutes, the men and women stand facing each other, shouting with good-natured banter. The noise slowly draws the people out of the police office. Sergeant Hopewell, Sarah and Terry all come out to see the fuss and stand watching the two lines slowly forming as Nick stands on the top of the Saxon directing them. Right, at the front you will see Blowers. That's him with his arm up. He's on the men's side. The other one, Cookie, that's him waving now. He's on the women's side. They will pass each chain the item to be moved up. The chain left with the last item still being passed up is the loser. Now, are you ready? A chorus of replies sounds out. I can't hear you. I said, are you ready? Nick booms out over the loudspeaker. 
The two lines roar and cheer as Blowers and Cookie position themselves at the end of the two chains, pretending to jump up and down and get ready. Malcolm walks out of the armory and stands bemused at the sight. Realising what's about to happen, he moves a few steps away and lights a much-needed cigarette. Three, two, one, go! Laughing like children, Blowers and Cookie burst away into the armory and race into the back room. They each grab a bucket of metal scraps and run back to the chain. Here come the first two. It's all even at the moment. Ah, oh, and the first buckets are into the chains and being passed up. Nick commentates as Blowers and Cookie run back inside to get the next ones. Blowers grabs two buckets as Cookie quickly grabs one and starts back. That's cheating, you wanker! Cookie yells as he goes back for another one and runs behind his friend to pass them onto the chain. The two lines roar and cheer as they see the two lads bursting out, each carrying two buckets. Sarah starts smiling at the sight and looks at Terry, laughing as the two lads push against each other to reach the lines first. Come on, Cookie! Terry yells. That's bloody Tom and Stephen in that line. Sergeant Hopewell laughs at seeing the two lads joining in with passing the items up. I'm joining in, Terry laughs and runs across to the front of the line. I'm not having that, Ted remarks from behind them, and jogs over to stand opposite Terry on the men's line. Blowers and Cookie keep running back into the armoury and grabbing buckets of metal to race back outside, waiting until they're in front of the people before they start barging into each other, both of them red in the face but laughing hard. Malcolm smiles as he quietly smokes, amazed at what's taking place in front of him. These people have suffered such loss, but here they are, joking and playing, doing anything to break the tension, and all it took was three young mischievous soldiers pissing about. His smile widens as he thinks back to the escapades that he, Chris and Clarence got up to early in their service. Nick continues with the commentary as people twist and turn, passing the items up, pointing out mistakes and making the others laugh and cheer. Dave, Jamie and Curtis stand next to the Saxon and watch the growing piles of buckets being quickly passed up. The inside area of the main gate quickly fills up as those closest to the front first hear Nick booming out on the loudspeaker and then the sounds of cheering. They pause in their training and drill to move back inside and stand smiling at the spectacle. Howie stands outside the police office, quietly drinking coffee and taking the scene in. He watches Terry smiling and laughing as she reaches out to take a bucket from Cookie before he turns to run back inside, pushing and shoving against blowers by his side. He watches as Tom and Stephen grasp their bucket in turn and laugh as it's passed on, shouting and urging the men to move faster. How can they all be taken? Fifty or so million people in Britain, and every one of them has had their life changed forever. The rich and powerful may have been whisked to safety inside bunkers, but even their lives are changed. The thought process leads Howie to think of the populations of different countries. This started in Eastern Europe somewhere, so that means the whole of Europe. And if it spread to an island like Britain so quickly, it must have gone everywhere. Every man, woman and child on the planet has had their life changed, and for what? For another species to develop? For another race to take over? or just an infection that courses through their systems without realising the futility of it all, that eventually it will infect everyone and have nothing left to feed on. He thinks of how McKinney would love this now, and would be laughing and joking up top with Nick and Curtis. Then he remembers Darren and the conversation they had on the bridge. With a jolt, he realises it was only this morning, only a few hours ago. It feels like days or weeks have gone by just in this one day, he thinks back to Friday night and being at home in his flat, watching television. That feels like years ago. He was a night manager in a supermarket then. Now he is a leader of men and making ready to fight an army of dead people. He shakes his head slowly in wonder. If only his father could see him now, how proud he would be. His thoughts darken once again as he thinks of his parents, now part of that army coming for them and of Darren's words on the bridge, Lord, give me the grace to have five minutes with Darren when we meet, just him and me alone for five minutes. How he sips his coffee, visualising the moment he would take him down and make him pay for all the bad things that have happened. 
He cocks his head to one side and adds a final request to his prayer. And can I have my axe with me, please? The race finishes with Cookie and Blowers both running out of the armory with their last bucket each, using their free hands to push and pull the other one back. They grapple with red, panting faces, still laughing as they stagger and slip over, somehow managing to keep their buckets upright. Finally, they separate and make it to their lines at the same time, passing their buckets over and then racing along with them as they get passed from man to man and woman to woman. Nick's voice grows hoarse with excitement. The ends of the lines disperse as the men and women race to keep up with the buckets. The buckets reach the last few people as the view is entirely blocked by everyone crowding round to watch. With a roar, the buckets reach the top in unison, both being placed at the top at the same time. It's a draw! Oh yes, a draw! The age-old battle of men versus women has finally been laid to rest here in Fort Spitbank with a draw! Nick ends his commentary as the crowds all mingle into one, cheering and laughing and slapping each other on the back. The day draws on, and slowly the camp returns to order as people file back down and continue with the tasks they had been doing. Clarence leads his group back outside and resumes the weapons drills. Howie watches as Dave and Jamie, now joined by several others on the top wall, all start moving the buckets to the cannon sites. Howie heads over towards the vehicle ramp leading to the top of the north wall, passing the engineer's workshop as he goes. He pauses to see Kelly inside, still moving between the various small groups of people and the growing pile of sharpened foot traps on the floor. She smiles and nods as he passes by. He continues on, passing smiling people moving back down to the camp. That was a good effort, Nick, Howie says as he reaches the Saxon. Thanks, Mr. Howie. It was a good laugh for a few minutes, Nick replies, now back on the GPMG and staring out to the flatlands through a pair of binoculars. How are they getting on out there, mate? Howie asks. Have a look. Nick passes the binoculars over. Howie lifts them to his eyes and starts scanning over the flatlands to the estate. The diggers have now finished and are moving back down to the fort, having moved all of the earth taken from the ditches over to the far sides. The long grass is now cut and being carried over to be stacked by the side of the freshly dug ditches. Men and women are working in the ditches to drive the sharpened stakes through, followed by more people covering the sections they've completed with the long grass. Howie sweeps over to see a van being driven slowly across the large area of land between the first ditch and the embankments, throwing the sharpened foot traps out onto the ground. Then he looks down to the first bank to see a group of archers firing into the bank. He watches them practice with firing high and people moving amongst them giving tips and offering advice. He sweeps the binox down to the deep ditch after the last bank and sees the fuel tanker parked on the road in the middle. Pipes connected to the fuel tanker are pumping fuel into the heavyweight hoses they found in the fort. More people are filling containers and big drums with fuel and then rolling them along the ground to be pushed into the ditch. Yet more people are wrapping metal shrapnel into bags and placing them on top of the drums and hoses. After the deep ditch, there is a wide open flatland to the fort, now covered with lots of people who stand listening to Clarence and Brian. The people issued with firearms have laid them down in piles. Now many of them hold the hand weapons foraged and brought back by Clarence, found within the compound or brought with them as they fled their homes. He knows Clarence and Brian are doing their best to give some simple instruction on how to hold the weapons and show them basic techniques of swipe, lunge and hack. As Howie lowers the binoculars, he realises that nearly everyone in the fort must now be involved in the defence and preparation. So much for his plans of keeping everything secret. Fuck it, Donald! Howie remembers the man he had locked up in the police office. Suddenly the action he took rests uncomfortably on his mind. At the time, his decision seemed reasonable. The man was delaying what needed to be done. Tell Dave I'll be straight back, Howie yells as he starts jogging back down the vehicle ramp and across the camp. The sudden thought that they have done something wrong, so very wrong, plagues his mind, and it must be put right. Where's that man we locked up? Howie asks as he bursts into the police office. That's what I want to bloody know, a distressed-looking woman standing in front of Sergeant Hopewell's desk yells out. Are you his wife? Howie asks. 
Yes, I am. They won't let me see him. They said he's been arrested. The woman sobs, eyes red and tears streaming down her face. She holds the hand of a small, scared-looking child. Where is he? Howie asks Sergeant Hopewell. In the back room. Ted's with him, she replies. Howie pushes his way forward and opens the door at the rear, entering a small corridor. Ted? Howie calls out. In here? Ted answers and steps out of an open door at the end. Is that man in there? Howie asks. Yes, he's right here, Ted answers, puzzled. Howie moves around Ted and enters the room to see Donald sitting on a chair in the corner of the room. His eyes are also red from crying. Donald, I'm so very sorry for locking you in here. It was unforgivable, Howie blurts out. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have questioned you. Please, can I just go? My wife and daughter are alone and they must be terrified, Donald pleads. No, you should have questioned us. I was completely wrong to have you detained like this. I didn't mean anything bad, Mr Howie. I was uncomfortable with what you were asking, but I shouldn't have made an issue out of it. You're right. There are thousands of people here relying on you, and I won't question you again. Donald stands up slowly, clearly unsure of the change of events, looking at Howie, then at the open door and Ted standing there with a frown. So, can I really go? he asks, tentatively. Mate, your wife and daughter are out in the office. Donald, you're all right. The woman from the office bursts in to hold Donald tight, crying and sobbing. The little girl holds back for a second until Donald drops down to draw her in close. Yes, I'm fine, darling. It was all a misunderstanding. Really, it's all fine, Donald says softly, holding them both. Look, Mr Howie, Donald's wife says, my husband Donald is an argumentative man and he picks the wrong moments to say things and has often caused a lot of offence, so I can understand where you're coming from. But for him to be taken away like that and with no one telling me why or for how long, that was awful. Yes, you're right. It was the wrong thing to do, Howie accepts quietly. Mr Howie, I do apologise to you for putting you in that position. Is there anything I can do to help now? Donald asks, holding his head up and staring directly at Howie. The engineers are still hard at it in the workshops. I'm sure they could do with some help. Right, in which case we should be leaving. Donald steps forward, holding a hand out to Howie. I understand why it happened the way it did, and for my part, I can see you are a genuine man, and I'm glad this fort has you on our side, Donald says as they shake hands. Thank you, that's a very kind thing to say, Howie replies. And as soon as society has been rebuilt, I will be contacting one of those no-win-no-fee lawyers for compensation. Donald smiles. Ha, <laughs> good idea. I'll say it was Ted. You won't be the first, that's for sure. Ted responds good-naturedly. The family leave the room, still holding each other tightly, leaving Ted staring hard at Howie and nodding gently. That took some balls, Howie. Well done, Ted says quietly. Don't give me credit, Ted. It shouldn't have happened in the first place, Howie replies. You did what you thought was right at the time. He wasn't injured or hurt and he's been well taken care of, Ted says firmly. Yeah, I guess. But the road to hell is paved with good intentions, Ted. At the top of the North Wall, two teams of people left over from the bucket chain and chosen by Dave move ammunition and powder bags to each of the cannon. Long hoses stretch along the top and down to the ground level and the outside taps found in each corner of the base of the wall. On further request, women bring piles of sheets, blankets and material up to be left with the ammunition. Dave crouches and draws his knife to cut a square of bedsheet, then takes a few double handfuls of bolts, nails and screws to put them in the centre of the sheet. He wraps the sheet over, securing the metal fragments inside. He then takes the small bundle and shoves it into the black opening of the cannon mouth. Too small, he mutters, and goes back to unwrap the sheet and add another double handful of the metal pieces. He wraps it back up and goes back to the cannon mouth, placing the bundle inside. Perfect. I need more of these made, the same size as this one. They must not be bigger than this, otherwise they will not fit, Dave says to a group of people watching him. You get them made and I'll start showing this lot the cannon drill he adds, turning to the two distinct teams nearby. Right, 
One group will be on this cannon, the other on the second one. Watch and listen carefully as we do not have a lot of time before night falls. And as soon as that area is clear, Dave indicates the flatlands, we will be having some practice shots to get range, distance and aim. Got it? The groups nod back, listening intently to the small, strange man. These are the fuses. Dave holds up some lengths of fuse wire to show the groups. They go into the hole at the back of the cannon. We do not have lighted material or naked flame anywhere near the fuse at any point other than when we are lighting it. You two are the flame holders. Dave indicates two men, one from each group. You keep the flame lit and away from the cannon until the teams are ready for you to light the fuse. Now we take a powder bag, this is full of gunpowder, and we place it into the cannon. That is your job. Dave indicates another man from each group. The powder bag is then rammed down to the bottom of the cannon, like this. Dave takes a ramrod and pushes it into the cannon, driving the bag down to the bottom and tapping it hard a few times. It must be at the bottom, so it pushes against the fuse wire sticking in through the hole. Next we take some wadding and again we push it down. Dave takes some papers from a pile near the cannon and rams it down with the ramrod. Next, we take the ammunition, in this case the wrapped metal, and again we push it down the cannon. The metal is wrapped simply to keep it together. When the fuse is lit, it burns down and ignites the powder bag. The powder bags explode instantly with a lot of force. The energy of the exploding matter cannot escape from the back or sides, so it is forced to move up the cannon, thereby driving our round, missile or projectile out of this end at great speed. The wrapping material will be burnt away and the metal ejected. As it leaves, it will start to spread, at the same time as becoming incredibly hot. Not only do the enemy suffer from the impact of the projectiles, they also suffer from the heat of the projectiles. Do you understand? He gets more nods from the people watching. Now, before the cannon can be used again, water is put in and swept through to make sure there are no burning materials left. Otherwise, as soon as you put the powder bags in, they will explode and kill everyone. Now, these cannon are made from iron. They are strong, but they are very old, and we cannot tell if they have stress fractures. Iron cannon can sometimes just explode from the force of the repeated firing. If that happens, you will all die. Got it? The men look to each other with alarm. We cannot fire at the moment because of the people out there, but we can practice and we will practice. Any questions? Will you be with us? One man asks straight away. For the practice, yes, of course I will be. No, I mean when we actually fire them for real. I don't know. How likely are they to explode? Another asks with genuine fear on his face. I don't know. Er, uh, have you ever fired one of these before? The same man asks. No. Now, any other questions before we start? No? Good. For the next hour, the two groups are drilled incessantly and without rest, Dave making each group go through the motions. He pushes them again and again, giving clear instructions and correcting where necessary. As the afternoon gives way to evening, Dave rests the groups, walks over to the Saxon positioned midway between the two cannon, and takes the radio from the front of the vehicle. Saxon to Mr. Howie or Chris? Chris to Saxon, go ahead. Saxon to Chris, we need to start live fire drills on the cannon. How long until the grounds are clear? Chris to Saxon, we are almost finished and will clear very soon. I will give you an update once we are clear. Saxon to Chris, roger that. Saxon out. Chris to Howie. Howie here. Go ahead, Chris. Did you get the last? We are almost finished at the front. Yeah, I got that, mate. I'll come down and meet you at the gate. Chris to Howie, Roger and out. Howie steps through the gate after finding a different guard happily on duty and wondering what mischief Blowers and Cookie might be causing elsewhere. He crosses the gap between the two walls, marvelling at how the two high, thick walls deaden the sound from both sides. We're just about done. Clarence calls out, leading his now large group of people back inside with Brian. Some of them are armed with rifles, and there is a much larger group armed with a collection of hand weapons. I think Chris is bringing the others back in now too, Howie replies. Are they all done then? Clarence asks, moving back to Howie and watching the rest pass through the gate and back into the fort. I think so. How did you get on with the training? Howie asks. 
The firearms were fine, some of them were a bit rusty, but there's enough good ones amongst them to keep the rest up to standard. Mind you, all they've got to do is point and shoot. What about the others with the hand weapons? To be honest, Clarence lowers his voice, that was a fucking nightmare. We'll be lucky if they don't all stab themselves before we even start. But what choice have they got? Not much we can do, mate. Just hope we whittle the numbers down before they get here, I guess. Here's Chris now. Howie nods at the line of vehicles coming down the road towards them. It'll be dark soon. Couple of hours to go, Clarence remarks, looking up at the sky. I wonder how soon they'll come, Howie says quietly, as the people head back into the fort, nodding at him and Clarence as they pass. Mr Howie? Howie turns to see a man at the head of a procession of archers. You are Mr Howie, aren't you? The man asks as he gets closer. Howie, yes. We're the archers. We need to know range and where we will be firing from. If we're back here, we've got no view. I was thinking we'd all be on the top of the inner wall to start with. Howie politely interrupts him. The man steps back to look up, but the outer wall blocks his view. It will reduce our range, yes, but we can fire from there, if that's where you want us. How far will you be able to fire to from the top of the inner wall? Howie asks. Hmm, now that obviously depends on the type of bow. We've got a few different ones here, but I won't bore you with all that. I'd say most of us will be able to reach just past the first embankment. That's great, Howie remarks, looking at Clarence, who nods back sincerely. There won't be any degree of aiming from that distance, though. We're working on the principle of there being a mass target and just firing into them, really. I think you're probably right. But would you be able to get a fire arrow into that ditch from the inner wall? Howie asks, pointing out towards the last embankment. Ah, now fire arrows have far less range and they're a bugger to aim over any distance. But if you just want it into the ditch, that'll be easy enough. Good. Can you make sure that you all have the ability to do that when the time is right? Howie asks. OK, we can do that. We saw them being filled up with explosive material. You relying on us to ignite them? I think we will be. Is that OK? Yes, of course. It is OK. Is it OK to go up now and work out the best position? No problem, Howie replies. Nick and Curtis are with our vehicle. Speak to them and let them know what you're doing. The man nods and joins the line of others walking back into the fort. Howie and Clarence turn to see the vehicles have now stopped, and Chris is walking towards them, looking tired and drawn. You look like shit, Chris, Clarence rumbles. You too, Chris smiles back at him. Mr Howie still looks fresh as a daisy, though. It's the easy living I had before all this, Howie jokes. Honestly, though, I'm fucking knackered. We all are, Howie. We'll need to rest when we can. Otherwise, we'll all be falling asleep mid-battle, Chris replies, rubbing his beard. So how is it? Howie asks, now yawning after the mention of being tired. It's all done, Chris replies. First ditch filled with spikes and covered with the grass. You can still see it, but it's quite well covered. The flat lands are completely covered with the caltrops. He trails off, seemingly losing his chain of thought. I saw the deep ditch being filled. Howie takes up where Chris leaves off and nods to the area of the ditch. We've got the archers ready to fire into it. Let's get inside, Chris says, as the radio clip to his belt comes to life with a hushed transmission. Point north, point north, contact, I have contact. The voice is quiet but clear, the speaker obviously holding his mouth close to the radio. Chris scrabbles for his radio, pressing the button and speaking quietly in return. Fort to Point North, receiving you. What do you see? Zombies. Lots of zombies, all coming our way. How far out is he? Clarence asks, turning to look back up the road to the estate. A few miles, I think Dave said, how he answers. Fort to Point North. How far out are you? Silence follows Chris's transmission. Fort to Point North. How far out are you? I repeat, how far out are you? Silence. Then a sound of movement comes through. Maybe he can't transmit if they're too close, Howie says, as they all stare at the radio. 
Fort de Point North. Hold down your transmit button twice if you cannot speak, Chris says quietly. The radio remains silent, then bursts to life with the sounds of struggling and the raised voice of a man shouting in desperation. They all stare at the radio in silence, listening to the struggle and the shouts coming through, then the sound of growling, followed by a sickening, tearing noise and a scream. Fuck, Howie mutters in horror, then the radio goes silent. Point west to fort. I heard that. I'm bugging out. Fort to points west and east. Roger that. Come back. I repeat, come back. The radio bursts to life with the sound of static and a high-pitched squealing. They stand, listening, unsure who is transmitting. The static and squealing fade, but the line remains open. One word is transmitted by a voice that only sounds part human. Howie! Fucking hell, Chris says in shock, the awful stretched out sound, looking at Howie. Howie! The same voice again. Howie stares at the radio, his heart beating faster and faster and his stomach dropping. We're coming, Howie! The goading tones are loud and clear. Chris and Clarence both stare at Howie. Let's go, Chris says, all signs of tiredness gone and his voice full of authority again. His voice springs them to action and they turn as one. Chris runs ahead and pulls the gates wide open to get the vehicles back inside. Clarence and Howie go straight through into the fort as Howie grabs his radio and holds it close to his mouth as he marches through the gates. Howie to Dave. Did you hear the last? Dave to Howie. Roger. We heard the last. Making ready now. Howie to all personnel. Switch to the pre-designated channel. Security breach on channel one. He pauses and switches to the channel himself. Howie to Dave. I want all the people with weapons on the top of the inner wall. Archers too. Get Nick on the loudspeaker. Dave to Howie. Roger that. On it now. Howie to Malcolm. Malcolm receiving. Go ahead, Howie. Malcolm, can you get all the ammunition to the top of the inner wall and let the triage and hospital points know what's going on? Roger that, Howie. Clarence! Howie shouts across to the big man. We need that fuel tanker in the estate. Find the driver and get it taken in. Use a car to bring the driver back. Roger, Clarence replies before darting off into the camp. Howie to Dave. Where do you want the fuel tanker placed? Dave to Howie, on the central road close to the edge of the estate, by the flatlands. Howie to Clarence, did you receive that? Clarence to Howie, Roger, got it. Attention please, attention please, Nick's voice booms out over the loudspeaker on the Saxon. Can all the people with firearms report to the top of the inner wall? Can all archers report to the top of the inner wall? Nick repeats the message several times as Howie ploughs through the edge of the camp towards the police office. The camp erupts with a sudden frenzy as the few closest to the radios hear the transmission. Then they see Clarence and Howie running in, and then the request made by Nick. People start running about, fearing the attack is taking place. Parents grab children as men and women alike grip their hand weapons. Mayhem ensues and the volume inside the fort is instantly raised. Howie makes it to the police office, bursting in to see the room now empty of people. The sergeant sits behind the desk, Terry and Sarah next to her, all of them staring at the radio. Oh, Howie, Sarah says, putting her hand to her mouth. That was awful. Yeah, not very nice, was it? Howie replies. Any news on the boats? Nothing yet, Terry replies. Get the children at the back and ready to load as soon as they get back. Where's Ted? Howie asks, looking around. He went to the front, Sergeant Hopewell says. I was going to ask him to go with the children, and uh, maybe you too, Debbie. They're going to need some strong people with them. Me? With children? Are you joking? Sergeant Hopewell blurts out. Oh, Is that a bad idea, then? Just look at what you did here in a couple of days. Terry and Sarah, too, Howie adds. Sending the women and children away, eh? Terry flares up. Why can't we stay and fight, too? 
to be honest, because we'll probably lose. And yes, women and children need to be saved. Those kids will need strong people, and you're it at the moment, Howie replies with a firm voice and fixed expression. As much as I hate to say this, I agree, Sarah says, looking to the two other women. Howie's right. Three more out there fighting is not going to make a difference, but being with the children and mothers does make a difference. So we run away while everyone else stays and dies, Terry says indignantly. If nothing else, we buy you time to get away, Howie says. It's up to you, but it makes sense to me. I've got to go. Howie leaves the three women discussing the idea and marches back into the camp, heading towards the North Wall. Tucker, where have you been all day, mate? Howie says as he collides with the large recruit. Mr Howie, I've got all the stores sorted. They're a bloody mess, Tucker replies. Bloody hell, mate, have you been doing that all day? Howie smiles at him. Well, they had the wrong food types mixed together. No regard for the dates or perishable items, and some were stacked on the floor. So I took one look at it and thought, Roy, this won't do. Even if that zombie army comes tonight, I want them to find nice, clean stores, Tucker explains with genuine zeal. Well done, mate. Good for you. Talking of food, though, Howie says, still walking towards the north wall and realising how hungry he is. Ah, now that is sorted, Mr Howie. I knew you'd all be hungry, so I've got some food already prepared. Really? Wow, Tucker, that's impressive, mate. Howie says, looking with admiration at him. It's nothing special, though, Mr Howie, just all the stuff we needed to use up. High-energy food, though, lots of carbs. You see, I found loads of pasta and tinned meat, and then there were vegetables that were going off, so I thought, Tucker, mate, it sounds great. Howie stops him as they reach the top of the vehicle ramp and walk towards the Saxon. Clarence to Howie, we're on our way now. Clarence's deep voice comes over the radio. Howie moves to the edge of the inner wall and looks down to see the tanker being driven down the road, followed by a small car. Howie to Clarence. Yeah, I can see you now. Be quick, mate. Howie to points west and east. We've got a vehicle going to the estate now. We'll be there for a few minutes, only if you can make it back in time. Point west, a heavy panting voice says. I'm not far away. I should make it. Point east to the fort. Likewise, I'm running like a lunatic. No sign of the army from my position. Howie to points west and east. Roger that. Clarence, did you receive the last? Yeah, I heard it. Keep running, gents, because we ain't stopping for long. Looking up, Howie sees Nick gripping the GPMG and staring hard towards the estate, and Curtis standing by the side of the vehicle, scanning with binoculars. See anything, Curtis? Howie calls over. Nothing yet, Mr Howie, he replies with the binoculars stuck firmly to his face. Howie looks about to see men running towards the waist-high wall. They find positions and lean down to rest their rifles, then start scanning ahead. The archers split into two groups, left and right, and concentrate on fixing strings to their bows and placing piles of arrows down at their feet. All along the line, men and women make ready and Howie notices some of them shake and tremble as they work with their equipment. Their faces are pale and drawn. The tension is palpable. He moves along to see Dave at the far end, next to one of the cannon, and speaking to a group of people. As he walks closer, Howie notices the heavy-looking bundles stacked on the ground to one side, long ramrods being held by some of the men, and powder bags ready to be loaded. Howie stops as the group break apart chatting amongst themselves. Dave, how's it going, mate? Howie asks as Dave steps over to him, the small man looking exactly the same as he did a week ago, with no sign of strain or tiredness. Good, Mr Howie, Dave replies with his usual reserve. I think we're about as ready as we'll ever be, Howie says, looking back at the long line of people standing along the top of the inner wall. Yes, Mr Howie, I think so. The cannon? Are they ready? Howie asks, looking down at the bags and piles of equipment. Yes, although we don't know the distance yet. Single shot can go quite far, but cluster or grape shot like this reduces the distance significantly. Like a shotgun then, Howie says. Exactly like a shotgun. More spread, but less range. Well, I guess we'll find out in a bit. Yeah, I guess so. I'll try a test fire on each when Clarence gets back in. 
So that tanker, do you think it will go up well? Yes. But aren't they designed to withstand heat and pressure? Howie asks. Yes, but I put loads of grenades in it, Dave says, still devoid of expression. Oh, well, that's good then. So, have you ever fired cannons before? No, well, no, not really. What do you mean? I've not fired a proper cannon before, not an old one like this. So what was it then? Similar. Similar? Similar how? I made one, Dave answers flatly. You made a cannon, Howie asks incredulously. Yes, although it was a one-time use only. Did it work? Dave looks directly at Howie as though the question need not be asked. Fair one, Howie says. Tucker's getting some food up for us, he adds. Good, we can eat, then sleep, Dave says with a nod. Sleep? How can we sleep? Howie asks. They won't come yet, Dave answers firmly. We heard them on the radio. They said, we're coming for you, Howie. Howie tries to imitate the voice, making himself laugh as he does it, but trailing off when he looks at Dave's deadpan expression. They'll wait at least a few more hours yet, Dave continues. How on earth could you possibly know that? They've covered a long distance on foot, so they'll be weaker now. Plus, it's still light and we can see them coming. They know we know they're here, so they know we'll be ready for them, Dave explains. So they will wait a few hours to rest and either attack during the night when we're at our lowest ebb or first thing in the morning when we're all tired. Oh yeah, I guess that makes sense, Howie says reluctantly. I hate it when you're always right like that. In fact... I want them to come now, just so you're wrong, he goes on smiling. Maybe they will, Mr. Howie, Dave concedes. But you don't think they will? No. You're certain of that? Yes, Mr. Howie. How certain? I don't understand. If you're wrong, you have to sing a song on the Saxon loudspeaker, Howie says, trying to keep a straight face. I have to what? Dave asks. Sing a song on the Saxon loudspeaker, but only if you're wrong. Dave stares at him. Okay, Mr. Howie, I'll do that, Dave says. Bloody hell, you will? A shocked Howie says. Yes, and you have to do it if you're wrong, Dave answers with a very rare grin. No, hang on a minute. Yes, Mr. Howie? Dave asks innocently. Grub is up, Tucker bellows from the Saxon, watching a line of people carrying metal trays covered with aluminium foil. Saved by the bell, Dave says quietly, and starts off towards the food. Oh, you're changing, Dave, Howie calls out. Trestle tables are carried up from the visitor centre and laid out in a row near the Saxon. Metal trays covered with foil are laid on them, along with piles of plates and stacks of cutlery. Howie walks over to the edge and looks down into the camp at the cooking points. People are gathered around and drifting over, holding their weapons under arms or clutched between knees, as they stand eating from paper plates with plastic forks. Tucker moves along the trestle table, fussing about like a hotel head chef, adjusting the trays and crimping the foil down firmer to keep the heat inside. Bloody hell, lads, where did you come from? How he laughs at seeing Blowers and Cookie first in the queue. We were here all along, Mr. Howie, Cookie says with a grin. Tucker, we wondered where you'd been all day, Blowers calls out. I've been doing proper work, not like you two standing about a gate all day and drinking coffee, Tucker shouts, smiling. Chris appears, walking up the vehicle ramp and over to join Howie, watching the queue of armed men and women walking along to get scoops of hot food piled onto their plates. You're right, mate, Howie asks the tired-looking man. Yeah, I think we're all set. Just got to wait for Clarence to get back, he replies as Dave stops to join them. Dave thinks they won't attack for a few hours, Howie says quietly, trying to keep out of earshot of the people wanting for food. It would make sense, Chris answers. Give him a chance to rest and get us all wound up and tired for a few hours, probably attack during the night or first thing in the morning. Oh, for fuck's sake, Howie mutters, as Dave gives another sly grin. What? Chris asks, looking between them. 
Nothing, Howie says, sighing. Clarence, the point's east and west. Where are you? We're ready to go. Clarence's voice comes out in stereo from all the radios attached in the area. Point east. I'm almost there. The man sounds exhausted. Point west. Hang on. The second voice sounds worse. The man struggling to speak as he runs. Minutes pass as everyone pauses, staring at the radios and waiting for an update. The food queue holds fast. The servers are frozen with ladles in mid-air as everyone waits with bated breath. The food's getting cold, Tucker mutters quietly, fretting about his beloved creation and moving down the tables to discreetly tug the foil covers back on. Clarence to Fort, we have both points. Repeat, we have both men. On our way back now. Cheering erupts from the top of the inner wall, knowing they've lost one man, but saved two more. The eating resumes as the foil is quickly pulled back off and the serving carries on. Howie, Chris and Dave are joined by Blowers and Cookie, both of them hungrily tucking into the food and shoveling it into their mouths quickly. There they are, Chris nods at the small car speeding down the road towards them. They watch as the car slows to enter the gates and hear as the gates are pulled closed, securing them inside. Thank fuck for that, Howie says quietly. We'll wait for Clarence and Malcolm and eat together, he adds. Within a few minutes, Clarence walks up the vehicle ramp accompanied by Malcolm, both of them carrying heavy canvas bags filled with ammunition. They dump the bags by the side of the Saxon and move over to join Howie and Chris as Howie motions with his head for Nick to come and join them, mouthing for him to get Curtis and Jamie on the way. Within a couple of minutes, they're all stood together for the first time that day. Howie, Dave, Blowers, Cookie, Curtis, Nick, Jamie and Tucker. Then Chris stood in the middle of his trusted comrades, Clarence and Malcolm. Well, we did it, Howie says. In one day we got the traps laid, found more weapons, rigged the estate, got two cannon working, hopefully, and even cooked a gourmet meal. Bloody impressive, if you ask me. And found time to play past the bucket, Nick adds, as they all smile. Let's get some food, Howie says. They move towards the tables and head for the back of the queue, chatting and joking amongst themselves. One of the people stood near the back, moves a few steps aside and motions for them to go ahead of him. It catches on, and within seconds, the waiting people have all stood back, quietly and respectfully. Thank you. Howie speaks clearly, nodding to them. The others join in, showing gratitude and offering polite thank yous as they move to the table. Have you already eaten? Clarence rumbles, looking at the dirty plate held by Blowers. Uh, no, Blowers says slowly, looking to Cookie and his dirty plate, which he quickly tucks behind his back. Bloody greedy if you ask me, Cookie says, nodding at Clarence. I'd never go back for seconds, personally. They get plates of steaming meat and vegetables, giving Tucker compliments about the food, and Howie notices the look of pride on the young man's face. They've worked hard today, all of them, fighting all day yesterday, then fleeing through the night to get here. Not one of them has moaned or complained, and this effort with the food now has lifted the spirits of everyone here. They move away from the table, juggling heaped plates and already eating as they head over to the wall and sit down in a wide circle. The sight of Howie, Chris, Clarence and the others all sitting down, eating and joking amongst themselves, sends a ripple out along the top of the inner wall, taking the edge off the fraught tension felt by all the other armed men and women. Mind if we join you? a voice asks. The group twist around to see Ted grinning, while Sarah, Sergeant Hopewell, Terry, Tom and Stephen get plates of food from the trestle table. A chorus of voices greets them as they shuffle around to make room. Sarah moves deftly to sit beside Clarence and smiles a big grin to Howie, who nods and smiles back at her. The conversations break into smaller chunks as they joke and banter amongst themselves. Easy conversation in easy company. Those that haven't met yet introduce themselves and nod greetings at one another. Before long, they're exchanging war stories of the last week. 
Tom and Stephen both, at the same time, tried to recount the time when Dave disarmed Tom with the taser. Howie glances around to see the top of the inner wall and the groups of people now stood or seated, chatting and talking quietly. Guns, rifles and bows stand propped up against the wall as the folks mingle. Howie thinks back to watching the television and then seeing the horrors start outside his house. The blind panic and screaming as he threw the contents of his flat out the zombies as they attacked. He'd forgotten the man leading them away with the armoured van and encouraging them into the town. Then the first hands-on attack as he killed his first zombie. That was the start right there. That feeling of anger and vengeance that surged through him. He thinks back to meeting up with Dave in the supermarket and again he gives thanks that he found Dave. Today has been the longest period they've spent apart in a week and having Dave back at his side now feels normal, like the balance is restored. I was thinking back to the supermarket, Dave, Howie says between mouthfuls. Yes, Mr Howie, Dave replies. All those bodies you stacked up. I wonder if you would have stayed there if I didn't come along. Probably. You think? I didn't have anywhere else to go, Dave answers matter-of-factly. Yes, maybe. Do you remember that fat woman that got stuck in the door? Howie says, bursting out laughing. Yes, and I remember you walking into the door and falling up the stairs too. Oh yeah, Howie chuckles. Well, at least I didn't put the wrong fuel into that car. I didn't fall over and shoot a car, Dave quips back, but still devoid of expression. Yeah, but you got stripped off pretty quickly when Sergeant Hopewell was watching us, Howie fires back. You broke my shotgun. When? In Portsmouth. At the barricade. You told me to, Howie says with mock indignation. I said to draw him out. Well, it was either that or my head, and I gave you another shotgun. Yes, you did. Thank you. That was that bloody John Jones. Nasty fucker and his son, too. The one you kept punching, Dave says. Yeah, him. I wonder what happened to them. I don't know, Mr Howie. It's been a long week, mate, Howie says after a pause. It has, Mr Howie. That bridge was good, Howie says. Tower Bridge, Dave asks. No, the first one in that village when we were turning it by hand and they kept falling off. Yes, Dave says, nodding. And that freaky one that caught my axe when I tried to chop his head off. That was horrible. The chainsaw was good. Ha! Did you see the chainsaw? I thought you were busy on your side, Howie laughs. I saw it, and the lump hammers, and the sledgehammer, and all the other tools you tried. The chainsaw was the best, though. I love the axe, mind you. I like knives, Dave says flatly. Do you? I'd never have noticed. I wonder how our Tesco lorry is doing. Those kids probably stole it. Yeah, probably. Howie pauses, taking another mouthful of food. Salisbury was good. I'm glad we went there, Howie says. Apart from that bloody officer, he adds. Charles Galloway Gibbs, Nick says, as Howie realises everyone else has gone quiet and is listening to him and Dave. Complete tool, Blower says. Now that was a hard night, getting that Saxon, Cookie adds. We did it though, Howie says. There must have been a thousand of them at least. Thanks to Dave and the GPMG, Blower says. Another five minutes and I think we'd be staggering round now too. Brains, I want cookie brains, Howie says to laughter from the recruits, remembering the jokes from before. So, which is better, the feast Tucker did in the barracks or this one, Howie asks seeing Tucker's face light up. The one at Salisbury was fucking lovely, Nick blurts. Sorry, I meant it was very nice, he adds quickly with a glance at Sergeant Hopewell. This is nice, but that was a feast and a half, Blowers agrees. The conversations carry on, of great meals eaten in faraway places, of dangerous missions undertaken by Chris, Malcolm and Clarence. The officers jump in with stories of incidents and strange crimes they've dealt with, each of them sharing an experience and memories of a life now gone, thinking this may be the last time they get to share something, to tell another human of who they are and where they came from. 
The close feeling shared amongst them grows and matures as they listen to each other, laughing or nodding with understanding. It's getting dark, Chris says, as the conversations start to trail off. They look up to the sky to see the beautiful swathes of red mixed with the golden rays of the dwindling light. Red sky at night, zombies delight, blowers mutters quietly. Right, so what's the plan? Howie asks. We wait for them to come and hope our traps work, then throw what we can at them from up here, and when that ends, we go down and meet them. That's what I think, anyway. Sounds about right to me, Chris nods back. Any other suggestions? Howie asks. Keep it fluid, Dave offers. We've planned as best we can, and now we just have to be able to react accordingly, he adds to nods and murmurs of agreement and stares of awe from Jamie, Tom and Stephen. Okay, keep your hand weapons to, uh, well, to hand, I guess. And in the meantime, let's try and rest, Howie says. They break apart slowly, lingering to have a few words with each other. Howie steps over to Sarah, drawing her away from the group. Any news on the boats? Howie asks quietly. Nothing yet, but we've spoken to the mothers and got the children ready to move. And Ted? Did you speak to him? He was reluctant, but said he would do it as it was you asking, Sarah replies. Howie looks over to see Ted looking back, giving a single knowing nod. Good. Let me know as soon as they're back. Howie, I... Well, Sarah says hesitantly... What is it? Howie asks with concern. Well, we've not really spoken since you got me, and... Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. It's been manic. No, you don't have to apologise. I just wanted to spend some time with my brother before... Well, before... You can say it, Howie smiles. Before they come for us. Yes, before they come, Sarah says softly. You seem so different now. It's only been a week and you've changed so much. I hardly recognised you. I couldn't believe it when I saw you fighting through those things in London. It doesn't feel like a week, Howie muses. It feels like a lifetime. What happened? How did you get like this? I don't know. I, I really don't. I was lucky, I guess. I was at home when it happened, and it was happening right outside my house. They were trying to get in to get me. I fought back, but there were so many. I thought I was done for. Then this van went past, leading them all away from me. I managed to get out, then the rest just sort of happened. I was heading home to Mum and Dad's house. I found some crappy old bicycle and was going on the motorway. This car went past me and then hit the barrier and flipped over. There was a woman in the wreckage. She was still alive when I got to her. I tried to pull her out and save her, but one of those things was in the car and bit her. She died as I was trying to save her. Howie explains in a flat, emotionless voice. That's awful, Sarah says. Yeah, but then, like I said, she died. I was crying and she came back and tried to bite my face off, Howie says. What did you do? Sarah asks. I kicked her to death, Howie replies. And I guess that was the point when I decided they were all dirty, evil scum. Then I went through a village and more of them came for me, so I set them on fire and probably burnt the village down in the process. And I got to a shop and killed some more, and finally got home and found the note from Mum and Dad saying they had gone to look for me. I went back home but couldn't find them, got attacked a few more times and killed some more of them. I went to work, met Dave, and figured Mum and Dad would have gone back to theirs. I went back again. They weren't there, and I sort of snapped. Snapped? Sarah asks. I went back to Borough Fair. I went back knowing I wanted to kill them one by one. Fortunately, Dave came with me, and we've been going ever since. I came up with this mad plan to get a tank to get through London to find you. Howie laughs. So we went to Salisbury to steal something big and hard, and ended up hooking up with that lot. He nods at the recruits nearby. Had more fights, killed more of them, and they wanted to stay with us, so we came to London. Howie, that's amazing, Sarah says, staring at her brother with awe. Not really. You stayed alive and fought back too. I saw what you did in the back of that van, Howie says. Howie, please don't get me wrong. You saved my life and many others by what you've done with Dave, but, well, I've never seen you so alive, so... I don't know. She trails off, uncertain of how to say it. 
It seems like you're enjoying it, Howie, she finally says, looking directly at him. Enjoying it? The end of the world and being surrounded by death and destruction, Howie replies with an offended and puzzled tone. The fighting, Howie. I saw you fighting in London. You were more alive than I've ever seen you. You were possessed. I saw your face and the way you were. I know you better than all of these people. What about Clarence, Chris, Malcolm? Did they look like they were enjoying it too? Have you seen Dave fight? Howie demands with anger. Yes, I saw Dave, Sarah replies softly. Well, did he look like he was enjoying it? What about Blowers and the rest? Howie, I don't know them. I only know you. It was shocking to see you like that, Sarah says. So, what would you prefer? That I stayed at home and hid under the blankets? That's not what I meant, Howie. I mean, you were enjoying it. It gave you pleasure, and that's wrong. Why? Why is it wrong? How did it feel when you and that other woman killed them all in the van? It felt awful, Howie. It was survival, and it had to be done, but that was it. No sense of victory? No feeling of righteousness? No, she says firmly. Howie pauses and looks down at his feet then slowly over to the flatlands and the estate in the distance, watching as the shadows lengthen and twilight takes over. Maybe it's wrong, maybe it's completely wrong, Howie says eventually, still looking away from Sarah. But the way I see it, it doesn't matter what the motivation or reason is, as long as it gets done, as long as those things are put down and killed. But I see your point. It's okay for Chris and the others to have that violence, but not your brother. Is that it? Something like that. Sarah replies in a soft voice. I don't know what to say, Howie shrugs. It is what it is. They want to kill us and we have to stop them. I know. Clarence seems like a nice bloke, Howie says with a sudden smile. Ha, <laughs> yes he does, Sarah smiles back, glad of the break in tension. Well, I'm going to try and sleep. You sticking around up here, Howie says. I'll be about. Sarah replies as Howie starts walking towards the Saxon. And Howie, she quickly adds, I know we weren't the type of brother and sister that said it, but I do love you, she says. Howie smiles back, the darkness lifted from his face for a few seconds. You too, sis. He walks off towards the Saxon, smiling and nodding at the people he passes. Clustering in and around the Saxon, they all try to rest and sleep. Although there are now hundreds of people at the top of the inner north wall, they take no chances and still keep one on the GPMG. Malcolm offers to take the first watch. Howie and Chris take the quiet interior of the Saxon, the rear doors closed, so they can have more peace. Howie beds down on a thick layer of army coats discarded in the warm weather. Chris on the cushioned bench seats. They make easy talk for a few seconds before Chris starts snoring loudly, leaving Howie alone to think about the words Sarah said to him as his mind tries to think. The rhythmic sounds from Chris get to work, and within seconds, Howie drifts off. I'm going to test fire the cannon, Mr Howie, Dave says, opening a rear door and leaning into the Saxon. OK, mate, Howie answers, sleepily. As Dave walks over, he notices the two cannon crews still in their groups, running through the drills he showed them earlier. They look at him eagerly as he approaches, and he notices the first crew move discreetly into position, waiting for the chance to do a live fire. Dave gets to the cannon and walks around, checking everything is in place. The powder bags, the wadding, the mounds of wrapped ammunition, the ramrods, the fuses, and finally the holder of the flame standing a short distance away. Good idea. Dave nods at the gas canister fitted with a welder's flame that stands a few metres away, a man standing next to it, holding a petrol lighter. We've got one on the other cannon too, the man replies proudly. Dave nods and completes his inspection. He walks around to the back of the cannon and looks down the length and out to the flatlands. We'll probably get maximum impact if we aim for them as they come out of the deep ditch after the second embankment, Dave says. Let's try it and see. He has one final look around to see the first crew all stood in their allocated positions, ready and waiting to go. He looks to the man with the lengths of fuse wire and nods once before stepping away to observe. The man steps forward and pushes the fuse into the cannon hole, feeling for the resistance as the bottom of the wire hits the inside base of the cannon. 
Powder! The man shouts and steps back. The next man picks up a powder bag and moves smartly over to the mouth of the cannon, pushing the bag inside. Ramrod! He shouts as the man with the long stick steps forward and beats the powder bag down to the bottom of the cannon. Wadding! The ramrod man shouts and steps back as the next man pushes wadding into the mouth of the cannon. Ramrod! He shouts, and again the man with the stick steps up and pushes the wadding firmly down the cannon. Ammunition! Then a wrapped bundle of nuts, bolts, nails and screws is pushed in. Ramrod! The man with the stick pushes it down. He steps back and checks everyone is clear before shouting, Fuse! The gas canister knob is already turned and the welder's torch has a soft yellow flame at the end. The flame holder lifts the gas canister and steps over to the fuse and once again checks everyone is standing well away. He presses the flame to the fuse and pauses for a second as the fuse takes light and starts burning down. Fire! He bellows and quickly steps back away from the expected recoil. They all stand with bated breath and hands covering ears as a huge bang rips through the air. The cannon is shot backwards as a massive tongue of fire shoots out the end with a thick black cloud. Dave is at the wall, upwind and watching as the second bank is clearly peppered with metal fragments striking the top and firing far beyond. He turns back to the crews waiting and the many people turn to watch. He gives a simple thumbs up and a rare smile as they cheer loudly. Good. Make it ready and we'll test the other one, Dave says, and watches as they burst into action and the hose man steps forward like a ceremonial guard to sluice any burning fragments from the inside of the cannon. At the next cannon, the first crew stands by and watches with the experienced eye of expert cannon firers, and the second crew position themselves and wait for Dave. Once again, he checks everything is in place before nodding once and stepping away. The second crew prove just as good as the first and move quickly, shouting for the next man as they each complete their duty. The holder of the flame steps forward and lights the fuse, shouting FIRE as he quickly moves away. Once again the cannon roars to life and flies backwards as a long orange flame comes out of the mouth, followed within a split second by thick black smoke. Dave is at the wall watching as the spinning metal fragments fly over the bank and reach a good distance into the flatlands. Good. Too high, though, Dave says, and moves over to remove a wedge used to raise the mouth of the cannon. That'll be perfect. Make it ready, he adds, before moving off back to the Saxon amidst the cheering and applauding again. He walks around the Saxon, checking on each of his men. Howie and Chris lead them, but Dave accepts them as his to be protected and watched. Although his different mind doesn't allow for the same feeling of impending doom the others have, he does feel a very keen sense of trepidation. Dave has worked alone on hundreds of missions and has been outnumbered many times before, but his ability to plan, fight and move quickly meant he was rarely in danger in the same way that others may perceive it. In order to have a fear of death, one must have a sense of life, and Dave simply does not tick that way. Complete the task in front of you while planning for the next one. Dave had worked alongside regular troops before, but his status always kept him aloof and away. But no matter how different he may be, this week has affected him. These men have become familiar to him. Their voices, their jokes, and the way they fight. Blowers and Cookie always side by side, joking. But when they fight, they do so with complete ferocity, always watching each other and covering the gaps. Tucker is a big lad, and not as fit as the others but he uses his bulk and size and overcomes that fear to drive on. Nick, a witty man with a good head for computers and electrical things. And again, he fights with his heart, never holding back and pushing on with savage intent. Curtis, he is competent, which may seem a lowly compliment, but a competent man is worth his weight in gold. He knows where to be at the right time and never complains. A good driver, too. Then there's Jamie, quiet like Dave, but still different. He's highly capable and willing to learn, and importantly, he's able to work alone, but not for his own ends. Dave looks at each of them as he passes and thinks of McKinney and how Howie reacted when he knew Dave was going to finish him. That was the deepest feeling Dave had ever felt. 
not for the loss of McKinney, but for the anger and betrayal he thought Howie must be holding towards him. Howie is a natural leader and has a rare ability to show error and mistakes but still command respect. Whatever may come from this battle, Dave knows one thing. Men like Howie must survive. They know right from wrong. They know what must be done. And then they work out how to do it. Men like these that make other men fight when otherwise they would be quivering in a corner and pissing themselves with fear. Dave positions himself at the back of the Saxon. Quietly finding a spot that means anyone trying to enter the vehicle from the back must first go past him. The bodyguard. The watchman. The night closes in, and for the first time in a week, Howie does not hear the howling of the undead voices lifting to roar in unison. He sleeps deeply, exhausted both in mind and body. They all sleep. All through the camp there is quiet, men and women strolling around chatting in muted tones, couples clasping each other tightly, knowing it might be the last time. Families huddle together and whisper words of love and life. Men keep their weapons close, and women hold their children. For tonight may be the last night of life. Past mistakes are forgotten, and petty squabbles are laid aside as they acknowledge the lives they have led and prepare for what may come. I wake up quickly, bathed in sweat, and I find myself sat bolt upright, breathing hard. Looking over, I see that Chris has already left. I know I was dreaming, but the images have faded instantly. I feel hot, still tired and dirty, but above all else, I need the toilet. I clamber out of the vehicle to find the others half asleep, drinking from mugs of hot coffee being handed around by Tucker and his new team of Catering Corps volunteers. Morning, Mr Howie. Fresh coffee for you, Tucker approaches me with a steaming mug. Not now, mate. Gotta go. The cramping in my stomach signifies an urgent action is required. I run off in just my socks. No time to go back for my boots left in the back of the vehicle. I start jogging down the vehicle ramp, desperately trying to remember where the closest toilet is. The jogging motion just makes it worse, though, and I can feel a pressing sensation pushing inside my stomach. Too much bloody coffee, I mutter as I speed up. People pass me, trying to stop and talk. I wave them off apologetically and keep going. There is no way I'm going to shit myself in front of all these people. This might be the last day of humanity, but I'm not going out with Chris, Blowers, Cookie and the rest of them all ripping the piss out of me. The visitor centre. That must have toilets. It's across the camp, but there's no alternative. There must be some closer ones, but I can't take the chance to stop and ask now. I run down the wide central path, veering around children and people, stepping out to chat. Fuck it, fuck it, I mutter under my breath as I run faster. I can feel my face going red and the cramping sensation is bloody awful. I want to stop and drop my trousers here, but that might not be a good thing. The hero of Fort Spitbank leaving a big steaming poo on the floor. No, that wouldn't go down very well. There it is, I can see it. There's lights on inside, making it glow in the still darkness of the night. I glance up quickly to see the sky is just starting to lift. I reach the door and see a queue of people stood holding toilet rolls in the wide reception area. After killing many zombies, using bad language and now preparing for an invasion of the undead army, I commit the worst British crime of all. I jump the queue. There's no other choice. If I don't get to a toilet now, I will void my pants. Sorry, I'm really sorry, I yell out as I run around the quiet men and women stood chatting. I see the door with the stick figure of a man on the front and burst through. Inside, the cubicles are all closed, with more people waiting patiently outside each one. I glance at the urinals, thinking for a split second of sitting on one of them instead. I grab my stomach as the cramping sensation doubles from the urgent motion of the running. A door opens in front of me and a man steps out. I stare pleadingly at the man waiting to go in. There's something in my eyes. He stares back with a look of absolute forgiveness on his face. Do you want to go next? He asks politely as I close the door in his face. Sorry, mate, I say through gritted teeth as I scrabble at my belt, cursing the stupid buckles. That's okay, when you've got to go, the man outside says. His speech leaves it open for me to finish, but I'm otherwise occupied, fighting the hardest battle yet with my trousers. Finally, I yank them down, pull my underpants down to my ankles and sit down. My ass hits cold plastic and I jump instantly back up as I realise I've sat on the closed toilet seat. 
fucking stupid toilet seat, I roar out, wrenching the blasted thing up to sit back down. My bowels explode with wretched venom as the bomb doors unleash a devastating payload on the poor porcelain toilet bowl beneath me. Oh my fucking god! I can't help the words coming out. My arse sputters like a Spitfire machine gun rattling fire at the enemy. The feeling of relief is immense. Here, uh, are you alright in there? The same man asks with polite concern at the long whimpering sounds coming from me. Yep, fine, I reply with a casual politeness, the spattering noise almost drowning my voice out. After several minutes, the cramping in my gut abates, and I'm left in a state of absolute bliss. That is, until the smell of shit hits my nose, and I become acutely aware of my surroundings. I twist around to the toilet roll holder, but it's empty. Everyone in the queue had their own rolls in hand. Uh, sorry, are you still there? I call out. Yes, the man replies. It appears I didn't bring any toilet roll with me. Would you have any spare I could borrow? I ask. A hand clutching a full toilet roll appears under the door, and I reach forward and take it gratefully. Thank you very much. You're welcome. After a double flushing of the toilet, I'm all done and open the door to see other men politely look away. But that's a shitload off your mind, someone says to a few sniggers. Thanks for the toilet roll, mate. I hand it back and move over to the wash basin and scrub my hands clean. At least the water's still running. Eventually I'm done and stroll out of the toilet and into the reception area, nodding apologetically at the people still waiting in the queue. Outside, I walk happily through the camp, heading back to the north wall and still feeling strangely warm and comforted. Walking back up the vehicle ramp, I notice they're all up and drinking coffee, stood around chatting as the first tendrils of daylight push into the night sky. I see Blowers, Cookie and Nick all smoking cigarettes. I see the red ends glowing brightly as they suck in the tobacco and exhale the lazy smoke clouds. The vapour wisps come from the coffee mugs. Chris stood off to one side is laughing with Malcolm. Clarence is talking quietly to Sarah. Curtis up on the GPMG at the top of the Saxon, the machine gun pointing off to the right, and Curtis leaning forward on his elbows, clutching a hot drink. Off to both sides I see people stretching lazily and talking in muted tones, nodding to each other. A man throws a cigarette onto the floor and brings his heavy boot down to grind it out. My heart starts beating faster. The scene slows down, and I feel like I'm wading through thick mud. Tucker strolls past me at the top of the ramp. He's looking at me and smiling. He holds a steaming mug of coffee out in front of him, ready for me to take it. It takes forever to reach him. My senses have become heightened and adrenaline is coursing through my system. I look past Tucker and see Dave stood by the wall, looking out at the flatlands. Something flashes far beyond him, a quick bright light in the distance. Everything slows, and I see Dave start to turn back towards us, his face strangely animated, and I watch as his mouth opens and his eyes are blazing. This is it. I know it. Cover! Dave's voice roars out into the quiet night, and it brings me back to reality in a heartbeat. To their credit, my group react Instantly. As one, they drop down and spin to face the flatlands. Hundreds of heads all along the top of the inner wall snap around to face us. Many within the camp hear Dave's awesome voice, and they too stop and turn to look up. I stand still and look out to the estate. The first bright flash is followed by a low, dull thump that rolls over the ground to my ears. Another bright flash, and then another, followed by a series of bright flashes spread all along the width of the estate. Soundless at first, the speed of light being far greater than the speed of sound. But the sound does reach us as the dull, echoing thumps roll out like soft drumbeats. Then the estate goes up. The whole of the thing, from far left to far right and as far back as the eye can see, explodes as one. The still dark sky is lit for many hundreds of miles around as a mammoth sheet wall of fire scorches high up into the air. My mouth drops open as I have never seen such a thing before. The most expensive special effects movies ever made cannot compare to this sight. A whole housing estate erupting instantaneously and filling the sky with flames the size of skyscrapers. Within a split second, 
the pressure wave and the sound hit us. As one, we are taken off our feet. Not a single person remains standing on the top of the inner wall. Down below in the camp, many are knocked down or simply drop to hug the earth in absolute terror. The ground seems to heave and the noise is more than words can describe. A thousand jet aircraft taking off at the same time while a thousand marching bands pound through my skull. I go flying off to the side. I could be screaming or silent. I have no concept. All I know is that my senses are overwhelmed with sight, sound and sensation. If there is a hell, then surely it has come alive here in this place. I stagger to my feet, not knowing what I'm doing. Looking around, I see every other person is down on the ground, burying their heads with their arms. All apart from Dave, who is stood side on to me. His face turned to watch his glorious work, his profile framed by the scorching flames behind him. How he remains standing is something I may never know, but he and I stand and watch with awe. The incredible sounds continue, and I see the flames are shooting out over the flatlands too, eviscerating everything in reach. This is something amazing. Something beautiful, created by one man who can barely hold a conversation. Dave suddenly looks up and tilts his head to one side, seemingly staring at something in the night sky. Incoming! He bellows with his huge voice, somehow drowning out the sounds of the explosion still reaching us. I look up, puzzled at what they could be firing at us from this distance, and especially after that explosion. Then I see it. A car on fire rolling over and over gently in the air as it sails hundreds of feet over the fort to land far out in the sea. I glance back up to see more fiery objects flying overhead, leaving long blazing trails of sparks and fire behind them like mini comets. I hear a loud wet slapping sound nearby and turn my head slowly, finding it hard to drag my eyes away from the glorious blaze. I look over and see a charred and smouldering torso laying on the ground a few metres away. Just a torso with the arms still attached. No legs or head, though. I watch it with curious detachment, then feel my body being slammed to the ground. Dave is up and grabbing at my arm, trying to pull me to my feet. He's just knocked me down, and now he wants me back up. Get up, Mr. Howie, he shouts at me, and his voice penetrates enough to get me to my feet and staggering behind him as he pulls me around to the back of the Saxon. He wrenches the rear doors open and shoves me bodily into the back. I get to my senses and shuffle forward to look out of the windscreen. Flaming body parts are landing all along the inner wall and behind us in the camp. Burnt and scorched heads, legs, arms and torsos torn apart and sent flying high into the sky to come tumbling back down upon us. Dave runs around the front of the vehicle and starts pulling at Sarah, yelling for her to get up. I run back and jump out of the Saxon, landing with both feet firm on the ground. I race round and lift Sarah to her feet by her shoulders, shoving her roughly towards the back of the vehicle. She looks dazed and confused, and we dodge burning body parts landing all around us. Dave, protect the cannon, I scream out. Dave turns to face me with a sudden realisation. I can only do one, he roars back and races off to the left. I run forward, grabbing at bodies and pulling them up. Someone screams and I look over to see an archer being squashed by a heavy zombie body landing on him, others scrabbling forward to try and pull the burning body away. I glance down into the camp and see chaos reigning, people running in all directions and screaming as the burning body parts come slamming down. Tents are ablaze and brave men and women beat at the deadly flames with coats and blankets. Malcolm is up and staring around with a look of utter horror on his face. I run over and grab his arms to make him face me. Malcolm, protect the other cannon. If those powder bags go up, we'll be fucked. I scream into his face several times until he quickly comes to and nods back at me before running off. Within a few minutes, my group are up and working, running up and down the top of the inner wall, stamping down on flaming body parts to beat them out. I run down to see Malcolm using the hose from the cannon, running about and spraying the water over any burning material. I'd forgot about the hoses and giving thanks once more for Dave's forward planning.
Dave joins me back in the middle, and together with our band of brothers, we stare out to the flatlands. The sky is much lighter now, and daylight is almost upon us. Thank fuck it didn't set the fuel off in the deep ditch, Chris says. His feet are planted apart, his hands on his hips as he stares out to the blazing estate. Dave, I want everyone up here to make ready. We'll use the Saxon to fire first as it has the range. Everyone else holds until they get closer so we don't waste ammunition. I bark out the order as I stride forward to stare out over the flatlands. I hear Dave take a sharp intake of breath and wait for his voice to come bellowing out. Make ready! You will make ready and wait! Hold your fire! The inner wall springs to action as hundreds of people surge forward to take up their arms. Clips are pushed in with a multitude of loud clicks. Firing bolts are racked back. Men and women make ready their weapons, ready to stand proud and fight. Silence falls amongst us. Even the camp seems quiet now as everyone prepares for the attack they know is coming. Blowers, get our lot formed up here. I indicate the area of the wall immediately in front of the Saxon and facing out down the road leading to the estate. Nick, you're on the GPMG. Dave and Jamie, I want you both sniping. Try and get that fucker Smith. They react without hesitation. Tucker runs up, carrying my rifle, and hands it over as he takes up position on the wall. I spare a glance to see my glorious men kneeling down and removing ammunition clips from their bags, placing them at their feet, ready for use. Their hands are steady, and there is a steely look in their eyes. Howie, my men are yours. Use them, Chris shouts from the back of the Saxon. Form up on the wall here, I bellow out, pointing at the space being used by my recruits. We focus our fire on that road, I shout out and watch as the guards from the commune jump in. Get your clips out and ready. Focus your fire. Hold until told. I hear blowers stepping smoothly into his corporal role. He moves along our line, checking each is ready. Cookie, I'll do this end. You do that one. Make sure they're all ready, blowers yells over to his friend. They split with each one moving off down the line of the wall, checking each man and woman is ready with their ammunition and repeating for them to hold their fire until told. Tucker runs past me, heading to the back of the Saxon. I pay little attention as I see Sarah running up the vehicle ramp towards us. I didn't see her go off anywhere, so I'm puzzled to see her coming back. Howie, the boats are back, she yells out. Get those children ready and get them loaded to go. I turn to Chris as he steps away from the Saxon, holding a salt rifle. Chris, I've got boats to take the children away. I've got this here. Can you go and make sure they move quickly? Got it, Chris replies and turns to jog after Sarah. I turn back to the wall as Tucker comes up beside me. Mr Howie, sir, he says. I turn to see him holding a pair of boots. My boots. I look down to see I'm still wearing just my socks. Well done, mate. I smile at him and walk over to the Saxon and start pulling them on. I glance to the side to see Dave and Jamie both have rifles with scopes attached. No suppressors or silencers now. They take position front and middle, looking directly at the road. I step away and see Blowers and Cookie returning to their posts, both of them nodding at me as they take position. The estate is still well ablaze, but I know it won't be long before they try and push through. I can imagine Darren is sending them in to find paths and routes safe enough to get through. I look up to see Nick standing calmly with the general purpose machine gun in front of him. He looks down and smiles. You ready, mate? I call up. Yes, Mr Howie, he says with a clear voice. Eyes on! Jamie shouts and every head snaps forward as the tension increases tenfold within a split second. Coming through now! Dave shouts out, sweeping along the estate line with his scope. Mr Howie! Nick calls out and throws down a pair of binoculars. I press them to my eyes and adjust the setting until the burning estate comes into focus. Most of the houses are gone. The sheer ferocity of the explosion has shredded everything on the estate. The fuel tanker and the open gas lines created such a powerful explosion that everything that could be burnt was burnt. Now, with very little left... The flames are dying down. Thick black smoke billows up into the sky, but between the wreckage and blackened stumps, I see the zombies pouring forward. A thick line of them comes into view through the smoke. 
Several of them drop from heat or flames, but the mass just keeps rolling forward. This is it, I bellow out. They're coming through the estate now, I report what I see. The sight of them triggers an instant response inside of me. The anger is knocking to come in, but I bite it down. I'll need it later, but for now, I can do this myself. Almost at the edge. Nick, you'll get a view of them any second. Roger! Nick shouts out loudly and racks the bolt back noisily. I glance up to see him tightly gripping the handles and staring ahead with ferocious concentration. I put the glasses back to my eyes and see them surging forward. Here they come, I shout as they reach within metres of the edge of the estate. I drop the binoculars down and watch with the naked eye. The edge of the estate suddenly comes alive as a solid black mass emerges. Nick, I shout out. Come on, Nick roars, and the air is split apart by the heavy, constant sound of the general purpose machine gun coming to life. Nick aims well and sweeps along the entire front row. From far left to far right, I can see bodies falling down as Nick sweeps across them, then back again. As the awesome power of the weapon shows true, I lift the binoculars again and follow Nick's arc of fire watching as the bodies are shredded apart and sent flying backwards into the pressed ranks behind them. The following hordes stumble over their fallen comrades. I sweep back and my heart sinks as I see a solid mass stretching back into the estate and no sign of the end. I move my view down and watch with my breath held as they near the first obstacle we prepared. They move as one, keeping their lines smartly and presenting a solid wall, not running, but not shuffling either. A steady pace as they advance. Go on, go on, Cookie urges them onto the next trap. Come on, you stupid fuckers, another voice joins in and is taken up as more shout out, urging and willing them to keep going. They reach the first ditch and I watch as the first few lines simply fall out of view, dropping into the ground. Cheering erupts up and down the wall as the forward ranks of zombies drop down to be impaled on the sharpened spikes. The pressure from the oncoming hordes keep driving the undead forward to topple into the wide ditch. Yes! Cookie shouts with violence in his voice. Have some of that! I spin around and look to the back of the fort. Sarah and Sergeant Hopewell are by the opened rear doors, urging the women and children to move out quickly. I guess Chris and the others must be outside lifting them into boats. I turn back in time to see the next ranks of zombies dropping down as they reach the ditch, but not going out of sight. The bodies must have stacked up deep enough to bridge the gap, but at least it slows them. And many have already been vanquished from the estate going up, and now the ditch. The GPMG roars with incessant noise as Nick continues to sweep from left to right in a steady motion. Then two more loud and distinct bangs join in as Dave and Jamie start firing with their high-powered rifles. Ready! I roar out and see a visible reaction as the men and women on the line seem to hunch forward, push their shoulders into their weapons and aim down the sights. I pause just for a second as I watch the front lines of the undead army start dropping down as they run over the foot traps. Fire! I drop the binoculars for a second and scream the word as loud as I can. I see a devastating effect as many of the zombies are dropped instantly by the volley. I use the binoculars again and see not only the firing from our weapons are dropping them, but the foot traps are working far greater than I had hoped. A small smile forms on my mouth as I see zombies staggering forward and then suddenly dropping down as their feet are penetrated by the deadly sharp metal barbs. They might not feel pain, but the physical action of the metal driving through their skin and breaking the delicate small bones of the foot is enough to make them fall down. All along the lines I see zombies blown apart and shredded by the deadly hail of bullets from the GPMG. The rifles and assault weapons also prove very effective. Not every shot is a headshot, but the simple action of being penetrated by a high-speed large-caliber rifle is enough to blow them backwards and knock more down. Dave and Jamie's shots are, without question, perfect. Puffs of pink mist explode time and time again as they blow the skulls apart and send deadly bone fragments into the closely packed horde. I glance up and down the line to see men and women using bolt-action rifles, rates of fire increasing as they aim. Fire, 
rack the bolt, aim and fire. The movements are becoming faster and more fluid with each shot. Placing the binoculars down, I stride forward and take up position on the wall with my assault rifle. Selecting single shot and pulling the bolt back, I take aim, which is almost completely unnecessary as there are so bloody many of them, so just waving the gun in their general direction will surely hit something. I pull aim for front centre, at the section of zombies coming down the central road. The better weapons being used by the recruits and guards in this section means those zombies are suffering high casualty rates and being withered as they advance. Each one dropped is instantly replaced, but still we pour fire into them and every shot counts as they are slowly reduced. My shots join the deafening noise as I fire into the oncoming mass. Working in concentrated silence, the minutes pass as the zombie army slowly but surely takes ground and moves ever closer to the fort, rising and falling as they step on the fallen bodies in front of them. The foot traps keep working and they keep dropping down, but still they keep coming until they are but metres away from the first embankment. With no sign of Darren, Dave and Jamie have taken up their assault rifles to increase the rate of fire sent from us. Nick brings the GPMG to focus the fire directly into the front centre line on the road. With the sustained firing of Nick and the recruits and the guards all using assault rifles, the zombies on the road are obliterated. Large gaps start forming as the following horde are forced to weave around the broken and mangled bodies. The undead army reaches the first embankment, and I watch as the first lines rise up and over the crest to pour down the other side. A huge boom sounds out off to my left, and I glance down just in time to see flames shooting out the end of the cannon, quickly followed by a cloud of thick black smoke. The results of the cannon fire are awesome, and a whole swathe of undead are eviscerated by the scorching metallic fragments. The second cannon off to my right then booms out. I keep my eyes on the horde this time, and realise that everyone else does too. The impact is simply staggering, and my mouth drops open as the grape shot from the cannon spreads out, becoming superheated by the incredible power of the cannon, and rips through whole lines of zombies. The projectiles go through the first rank like butter, and several lines back are instantly taken down. Each shot of the cannon destroys hundreds at a time. Again, large gaps form as the zombies can't move fast enough to fill the gaps, and now the front line is not solid. But still, they keep coming and it takes moments to prepare the cannon for the next round of firing. That was fucking awesome, Cookie says during the pause of firing, as we all watch the effect of the second cannon firing. Eyes front, Dave bellows, and snaps us all back to the moment. Stepping back, I look down the top of the inner wall to see the archers have split into two groups. One group on the left, and the other on the right. Two archers from each group are standing next to the cannon flame holder, their bows dipped down with arrows resting against the wire in the rest position. The end of the arrows have been swathed in something, ready to be lit and fired into the deep ditch. As the zombies reach halfway between the two embankments, the archers are given an order to prepare. They move out into a long line stood well back from the wall. Each of them presses the arrow into wire as they lift their bows and pull back to stand braced. For a second, I'm transported to medieval England as I see long lines of archers holding their bows aimed high into the air. Release! someone shouts, and the bowmen and women release their arrows to fly high and straight. The arrows reach the arc of their trajectory and the strength of gravity takes over, pulling them back to earth, gathering speed as they plummet down. The arrows drive into the zombie army, many of them striking into the exposed skulls and taking zombies down with instant kills. Some of the arrows hit arms and legs, causing the zombies to be pushed down, only to rise back up and keep going with the long barbs stuck through their limbs. Some of them crawl along the ground, only to be trampled down by more zombie feet already pierced and damaged by the foot traps. As the first volley of arrows hit home, the second volley is already in the air. The two cannon both fire with massive recoiling booms, and again whole swathes of undead are killed outright. More large gaps form, and their lines become more ragged. The GPMG, the assault rifles, the single-shot rifles, the cannon and the archers all pour deadly fire into the undead army as we continue to cull their numbers. I see him! Jamie drops his assault rifle to quickly pick up the scoped sniper rifle. Where? 
I call out, ceasing fire to glare out at the army. Sir, he's on the road, about 50 metres back from the front line. There's a whole dense section clustered around him, Jamie shouts back as he rests the rifle on the wall and looks down the scope. Dave has already dropped his assault rifle and picked up his rifle to rest alongside Jamie and stare down the scope. I see the dense section, Dave shouts out. Nick, fire into the middle! I turn and shout at Nick, waving my arm to show him where I want the fire aimed. Nick nods once, grim-faced, and turns the heavy calibre weapon onto the front middle section. They're at the second bank, Clarence's deep voice shouts. I look across and see the zombies are now scaling the far side. They reach the crest of the embankment. Fire archers, make ready, I shout out, but the constant and sustained noise prevents my voice from reaching the archers further down the lines. I run back to the Saxon and pull the microphone out. Fire archers, make ready, I repeat, and my voice is amplified down the lines. The fire archers move in to cluster round the cannon flame holder. He presses the flame against the ends of their arrows, which start burning with oily black smoke curling up. The fire archers step forward to get a view from the wall and hold with their arrows pointing down to the ground. The zombies scale the bank and start pouring down the near side, dropping down into the fuel-filled ditch. I hesitate to give more time until the near side bank is thick with undead staggering down. I glance across to see the fire archers staring at me with pleading looks. I raise my right arm up high, signalling the archers, who pull their arrows back and take aim with their bows. Clarence turns to stare at me, glaring at me to give the order to release, but I hold and wait for more undead to drop down. The ditch is deep, and I know they can't climb out, so they will have to use the bodies of their undead brethren to bridge the gap. The risk is that the ditch will become too clogged with bodies and prevent the arrows from igniting the fuel. At the last second, when the guards and recruits are turning to look at me with desperate looks, I push the button down on the microphone and lift the mouthpiece. Release fire arrows! The archers release and their arrows fly out, leaving a thin black trail hanging in the air behind them. The timing is perfect. The arrows strike home and the flaming heads ignite the fuel held in the hoses and containers. They detonate within a split second as the ditches explode. Bodies are flung high up into the air and the pressure wave clears the near side bank instantly as the bodies are pushed back up and go spinning off. The zombies still coming over the crest are then met with a boiling surge of flames and metal fragments. More and more of the undead are shredded and turned to carbon. The zombies on the road are being taken down in droves. The GPMG and the assault rifles held by the recruits and guards concentrate solely on them. The incredible sustained fire withers the lines and soon there is a very deep horseshoe shape forming. The undead react and rather than just filling the gap from behind, they surge in from the left and right, seemingly desperate to keep that area protected. The undead keep surging up the second bank and down the near side to be instantly incinerated by the wall of flames leaping up from the deep ditch. With every gun now aimed at the road, we hold them at bay. We take many down and slowly, ever so slowly, we reduce their numbers. Dave and Jamie lean forward with their rifles resting on the wall, their breathing slow and controlled, looking intently down the scope and gently squeezing the trigger to send a bullet with Darren's name etched on it spinning to his evil undead skull. However, the zombies appear unwilling to give up their beloved leader, and they press into densely packed ranks ahead of him, pouring in from the sides to present an undead shield. He keeps moving back, Dave reports out loud, his voice matching his manner, calm and controlled. A huge boom on my right and the cannon sends another deadly hail into the ranks of zombies, still trying to come down the road. The cannon crew take the initiative to adjust the aim and focus on the middle section. Once again, the effect is devastating. A large chunk of bodies is simply swept away. We keep pouring everything we have at them. Each man and woman is firing with precision and speed that depletes our ammunition as quickly as it cuts them down. Glancing down the line, I see people scrabbling about and looking for fresh magazines. Chris runs back up the vehicle ramp and pauses at the side of the Saxon as Nick shouts down at him, then runs to join me. 
Kids are loaded and away, he pants. Nick said he's got one magazine left after this. We're running out here too, I shout back at him. But look, the end is in sight, I point out to the flatlands and rear end of the zombie army now in view. I run back to the Saxon, and the sight of the camp below stops me in my tracks. Thousands of people are standing still and looking up at us, armed with whatever weapons they can find. They stand quietly, not one of them flinching or crying. Something about the visual image stops me in my tracks, and I look back to the flatlands and the army moving towards us. They still outnumber us massively, but at least I can see the end of them now. They are no longer infinite. They are finite. They are a set number, and that number is being reduced with each bullet, arrow and cannon shot sent their way. Nick! Wait until we run out of ammo, then open up with that last magazine. Keep your fire concentrated on the middle section so we can get out to meet them. You join us as soon as possible, I say to Nick as he works with now well-practiced hands to load up the last magazine. Got it, Mr Howie. I'll be right behind you. I'm out, Clarence shouts, simply dropping his assault rifle and stepping away. Within a few seconds, the last of the shots are being fired by Jamie and Dave, their rate of fire with the sniper rifles much slower than the assault rifles. Here it is. The time we all knew was coming. With hard and staring eyes and a nod, Clarence moves around to the back of the Saxon and starts drawing our hand weapons out. JPMG now! Dave roars as the undead start gaining ground on the road, slowly advancing towards the fort. Nick squeezes the trigger for the last time, as the glorious weapon roars to life, spewing its deadly rounds into the zombies. Within seconds, they're being repelled back. Dave stands slowly, gently resting the sniper rifle against the wall. He gently rolls his head from side to side, stretching his neck and rolling his shoulder joints. I watch him open and close his hands, making tight fists and stretching the fingers out. He turns to stare at me, his eyes blazing. His hands move behind his back and slowly draw the long, straight-bladed knives out. Then he stands motionless, with the knives turned up against his forearms. A chill runs down my spine and the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. Clarence steps from the back of the Saxon, clutching a load of long-handled axes, foraged and saved for us. One by one, my recruits and Chris's guards take an axe and stand, ready and waiting. Clarence hands the last one out, then leans back into the Saxon and draws two more axes out, each one with a long handle and a double-bladed head. He hands one to me, which I take. A surge of adrenaline pulses through me as I grasp the weapon and feel the weight. Go down, I'll be right behind you, I say to the group. They nod and turn to start moving quickly down the vehicle ramp. Dave joins me and we stand together, watching every man and woman walk past us, holding a variety of weapons. The rifles and bows, now redundant, are left by the wall. The two cannons each give an almighty boom as they fire their last shots, decimating several ranks of zombies in the process. The crews abandon their posts and run down the vehicle ramp. Dave and I start after them, getting a firm nod from Nick as we go. Well... This is it, mate, I say to Dave. It is, Mr Howie. Been a bloody long week, mate. It has been, Mr Howie. Are you ever going to call me just Howie? No, Mr Howie. You got your knives, then? Yes, you got your axe, too. Yeah, it's a good axe. I like knives. I know, mate. We did well. We did, Mr Howie. We killed bloody loads of them. We did. Dave replies, as we reach the bottom and walk through the silent crowd to the front. Still a lot left, though. There is. I was worried for a minute. What about, Mr Howie? I thought we'd kill them all and not have any left. We reach the front and I look back at the thousands of people now crammed into the front of the fort, all of them facing the now open gates and staring hard at the outer wall and the horror that lies on the other side. Is there a plan? Someone shouts and every face turns to look at me with expectation. Yeah, we kill them all, I shout back instantly, that familiar feeling just starting to pluck at my insides. We go out there and we fucking kill every one of them, 
We slaughter them and we keep going until the last man is standing. We do not give up. We do not retreat. We do not back down. We are the living and they are the dead. My voice roars out as I feel the anger building inside me. Do not give in. We have killed many of them already. You will see thousands upon thousands of them. But we are thousands too. And they are weak and dead. We are alive and we have strength and we will stand together. The recruits, guards and men of the front line stand with faces flushed as they too allow their anger to course through their veins. Stay together, aim for the head and keep a tight grip on your weapon. I turn back to face the doors, two men standing ready, grasping the handles ready to pull the big gates open. And we wait for the GPMG to run out of bullets. Where are you? I'm here. You coming? Do you want me to come? You know I do. Bring your associates too. No. No? I won't. Why not? Because you want me. That's why not. I do want you. I need you. An addict's words, Howie. So? Sarah was right. You're addicted and you're enjoying it. No, I am not. Then do it yourself. You've had lots of practice and you're a big boy now. I don't want to do it myself. I want you to help me. No, Howie. I told you there was a cost to using me. I don't care about the cost. You should care, Howie. Why? It will destroy you if you keep using me. I will be destroyed if I don't. We all will. What about after? What then, Howie? There won't be an after without you. Do it yourself. Do it without me. No, I won't. It's not the same without you. You want this fight, Howie. You want it. No, I don't, but it's here and I have to deal with it. Run, hide, do something else. Do anything else. I won't run or hide. Admit that you want it. I don't want it. Admit it, Howie. Admit it and tell me you want it. No. I want to hear you say it, Howie. Okay. Say it. Will you help me if I say it? Say it, Howie. I want it. Louder. I want it! Louder, Howie. I can't hear you. I fucking want it! I want this fight! Come on, Howie. Snarl, scream, make me hear you. I want them to suffer. I want revenge. I want to kill them. Good, Howie. Will you come? I'm already here. I always have been. My heart thumps strong in my chest. My rate of breathing increases as my system floods with oxygen and surges with adrenaline. The whites of my knuckles are stark from gripping the handle of the axe so tightly. I wait for the thumping sound of the machine gun to end. Glancing to my sides, I see every man and woman on that front line has a grim and determined expression, and eyes full of rage. Lips twitch and snarl as we struggle to hold the anger in check. Eyes narrow, and brows become furrowed in these few seconds. I take a step forward, wanting to be the first out, wanting that first kill. Dave takes a step forward and joins me. Then the rest of the line follows, followed by the thousands of people behind us, all moving forward. I look left and right with a snarl on my face, unable to contain the growing fury. Snarling faces look back at me, wild animals, feral, untamed. I step forward again, so does Dave and the rest. In frustration, but too full of rage to voice my thought process, I growl deep in my throat and again take a step forward. Dave steps with me. And then everyone else does too. Then there is silence. Sudden and unexpected. The two men holding the large gates lean forward and pull with all their might. The doors open inwards but it feels slow. So slow. I fear I will explode if I don't get out there now. I can feel myself inching forward. Waiting for that gap to just open enough and I'll get through it. I feel a pressure across my waist. And I look down to see Dave holding his arm out across me. We go together, he growls, but inches forward as he says it. Fine, I growl back, and stretch my arm across his waist too, both of us pushing against the arm of the other, inching forward together. 
I feel another pressure and see Chris on my other side, his shoulder leaning into mine and trying to hold me back. A quick glance, and everyone is holding everyone else back. Shoulders pressed tight, arms stretched out. Every one of us wants to be the first. So we hold each other back, and in doing so, our entire front line growls and snarls as we inch forward as one, leaning forward. The big gates are old, and they are very heavy. The hinges are tight, and the gates just brush the ground as they open, causing friction and resistance to the men pulling them. As the gap widens to a man-sized width, they come free and the friction ends. The gates are pulled wide open within a second or two, and there they are. The zombie army is in front of us, in all their decaying, decomposing and fetid glory. Ready, Dave? I snarl. Yes, Mr. Howie, he snarls back at me. Ready, lads? I roar, as loud as my cracking voice will allow. Yes! Thousands of voices filled with fear and rage roar back at me. Dave's arm drops from my waist. I drop my arm from his and we break free, charging at the wide entrance. There's a guttural, animalistic roar as I'm finally allowed to unleash the pure fury inside. Dave's voice joins mine along with Chris, Clarence, Blowers, Cookie and Curtis, Tucker, Jamie and Malcolm. Our voices become many and the sound of it drives us on. The gates are only wide enough for a few at a time and we are the first out and heading for the road in the middle. The deep ditches are now crawling with smoking zombies climbing out onto our side. The army of the living faces the army of the dead. We spread out as we pour through the gate. The undead army speeds up coming at us. We speed up and charge at them. They charge at us. The gap between the ditches is our meeting point and we both know it. As we take the last few paces towards each other, I lift my axe high out to the right, pulling my shoulder back and preparing for the impact. An image of Sarah suddenly fills my mind, safe and protected out on the boats with the children and their mothers. My parents are gone, but at least she is safe. And the more of these we take down now, the better chance for survival they have. We go to meet death, and we all know it. The power of hope keeps a glimmer alive that maybe we'll walk away from this. But a conflicting dose of reality makes it known that we stand very little chance. Ah, hope says, but there is a chance. For Sarah, I will go to meet my death. For those children and the hope for mankind, I will go to meet my death. For that slim chance that we can destroy this evil spawn, I will go to meet my death. My name is Howie. I was named after my father, Howard, but it became too confusing to have two Howards, so I became Howie. I'm 27 years old, and I'm the leader of the living army. I bring death to you. The undead stretches forward at me. His upper body leans forward and his lips pull back to reveal a row of uneven and dirty yellow teeth. His movement exposes his neck and I slam the axe blade into it, slicing through cleanly, and the head simply drops from view. The first drops of blood are spilled, and if nothing else, I will know that I did that. I drew first blood in this battle. The axe drives on in the powerful arc as the blade bites into the face of the next undead, cleaving through the cheekbone and taking half the face off. I twist around and use my momentum to ram my right shoulder into the next one. He gets propelled backwards, and I uppercut the axe into his groin, almost cutting him in half. I glimpse Dave dropping low and driving forward to plough through the first few lines to rise up deep within their ranks. For one glorious second, he pauses, a mighty look of concentrated fury on his face, and he gives a small smile. Then he sets to work, and the amazing ability of his body bursts with life as he starts spinning, dropping, turning, twisting, and with each poetic movement, an undead body drops with a cut throat. For a split second, I feel guilty. Guilty that we've brought an army to fight them when all we ever needed was Dave and two knives. Back to reality, and I swipe the axe out wide, slicing through shoulders, arms and faces as I create space around me. For a minute we gain ground as the first few lines drop easily from the weapons used, but then the sheer numbers on their side compress against the backs of the line in front of us, and now we hold, neither gaining nor losing ground. We hold our lines, and kill them as they step and lunge forward. I have no idea how the rest of the line is working. 
whether the undead army have burst through the deep ditches, if our line is too spread out or too tightly packed. All I can do now is fight and kill the thing in front of me. The first wild sweeps clear a space around me, but then I settle down to practice strikes and lunges, conserving energy and strength. My axe bites into skull after skull as I sweep back and forth, lunging forward and driving the axe overhead to destroy, kill, maim and end the undead lives of these foul abominations. The fury surges through me and I work faster and harder than ever before. Each killing blow drives me on. Step back! A voice roars nearby, and for a second I'm confused as to why we are giving ground, but then I realise we're fighting and tripping over the bodies on the ground. We step back and allow the undead lines to stumble and clamber over their dead comrades. We take advantage of the obstacles and cut them down in droves, adding more and more broken bodies to growing piles. The glory of battle is within me as I swing my axe, cleaving, smashing, pulping and destroying. I take two down with a massive swing and catch another fleeting glimpse of Dave, still deep within the ranks. He leaps high into the air, his arms rising above his head as he dives back down. Bright arcs of blood spurt into the air to show the path he weaves. Clarence simply uses his awesome strength, gripping the axe at the base of the shaft. He swings left and takes several down at once, then pauses for the next row to step forward and then swings right, taking them down and repeating the action over and again. The undead are simply too stupid to learn from his tactic. Chris and Malcolm work like I do, taking small choppy lunges and sweeps to target each victim and take them down with the smallest expenditure of energy. Blowers and Cookie stand side by side, fighting like demons. Tucker has that look of terrified rage on his face, and uses his bulk to swing out and take them down. Jamie, small and lithe like Dave, holds knives in each hand and attacks one zombie at a time with clinical precision, never overextending and always aware of the next target. Zombie after zombie, axe swing after axe swing, and we go on fighting and battling. Strike and move, strike and move. Heads keep lunging at me, and I strike across to smash the things apart. Skulls cleaved open like ripe melons shower me in greying brain matter. One appears in front of me, the skin on his face already falling off, exposing dirty white bone underneath. The remains of his lips pull back and his mouth opens. Strands of saliva drool and hang down as he comes in close for the bite. I lash out hard, and the axe takes the top of his head off. Another one steps to my right, a fat female undead. How she kept up with the mass marching is beyond me. I keep the swing going and drive into her neck, severing through the spinal column and she goes down. Stepping forward to meet the next one, I drop him with an overhead smash, then step forward as I uppercut, wasting no energy and making use of each swing of the heavy axe. I sense someone fighting right behind me, and I catch a quick glimpse of Clarence, ploughing away. I move forward again, and Clarence steps up to my right side, exchanging a quick look, we both step and swing forward. Suddenly, Chris is on my left, and the three of us fight together, side by side. Then Malcolm joins our line on the other side of Chris, and now we are four, synchronised and swinging the axes, left to right, right to left. The effect is awesome, and we make headway, stepping forward and tramping the broken and mashed up bodies underneath us. Watch the sides, Chris bellows, as we drive in too deep and the zombie army starts curling round and attacking Malcolm and Clarence to the sides. Blowers and Cookie move up and fight out to the sides, joined by Tucker, Curtis and Nick running in fresh with an axe he'd kept back in the Saxon. Some of the guards join us and we form a circle, just as we did in London, fighting forward and presenting a solid wall on four sides. With my friends to my sides and behind me, I feel a fresh surge of energy and we fight on. The zombie army pressing in as we keep our shape and drive further and further into their ranks. Every time I glance up, I see bodies being dropped by Dave just feet from me. I realise he's staying close, offering his never-ending protection. For every zombie I take down, Dave takes down two or three, and his kill rate alone must be destroying so many. The heat becomes unbearable and sweat pours off us, so many bodies all pushed into a tight space, and I become aware of their fetid and disgusting odour, the stench of their breath the smell of decomposing and rotting flesh. They now truly are the living dead. 
They are corpses, infected with evil, and something dark works inside of them and drives them with an insatiable hunger for human flesh. Their presence offends and disgusts me, the way they keep coming, wave after wave of zombie bodies being thrown against us. The rage threatens to burst me apart and I fight harder, faster, striking with more power than I have ever done. The fury within me is so powerful, yet it isn't enough. Give me more. Give me more rage and anger. Fill me with utter vengeance and make me stronger. With frustration and blind anger, I roar out with animalistic rage, my voice guttural and wild. I hack and hack away, killing and destroying all within my range. Nothing matters now. My thirst for death will never be satiated. I want death and destruction. I want to bathe in their blood and tear their evil bodies apart with my bare hands. Darren is in there somewhere. I fight harder for every step I take brings me closer to him. I told him to come after me. I told him to see what happens if he tried. Now he's here, but he's hiding from me. I want him. More than anything, I want him. He is the evil. He is the devil spawn that brought this plague to my people. He is the reason we have all suffered. I am death, Darren. I am death, and I am coming for you. I told you I would destroy you, and I will. I fight and kill as I push on deeper and deeper into their ranks. I am the spearhead that drives through these ranks and my men fight with me. This isn't enough, though. The power of the anger and rage is not enough. I want more. Give me more. Give me all the fury of the world and channel it into my arms so I can fight on. Why isn't it enough? Why am I not strong enough to surge forward and sweep these things away? Frustration mixes in with the already powerful feelings pulsing through me, and for a few minutes, I have extra strength and more speed. I fight away from my circle. I plough deep into their lines. I hear Clarence and Chris shouting my name, but I pay no heed. They are together and protected, and I am already dead. I made that deal with myself when I came out here. I knew I would be coming to my death, and I will do it on my own terms. I will not expose my friends to my reckless actions, but reckless as they are, they are my actions that I choose to take, and I take them willingly. I fight on and push harder, sweeping my beloved axe around and around, cleaving and hacking and killing. They cannot touch me, for the anger and fury is so great within me, but no, it isn't enough, and I feel my power abating. It ebbs away and I drive myself on, pushing myself and forcing the rage out. I can't see my men now. I'm too deep within their lines, but I keep going. For as long as this power is within me, I can kill them. My killing blows start to ease off. The power generated by each swing is less and less. I swing out, and the tears of frustration sting my eyes. I feel my power leaving me, and there are so many crowding around me. I lash out again and stumble as my legs start to shake. I roar out, but my voice feels weak. I lift the axe and smash a face in, but the power is so much weaker now. My men, I can see them. Through my tear-filled eyes, I see them fighting, but their power is weakening too. We are trapped with the evil undead crowding around us. My legs feel so heavy, and each step finds me faltering and staggering. I look over to my men and see their circle starting to give. Tucker swings out, his normally ruddy face now pale and drawn. He too can feel the power leaving. And I see his swings getting more and more feeble. I scream as they lunge forward and take him down. They drag Tucker to the floor and the undead bodies are on him, frenziedly biting and tearing at his flesh. I scream out loud, my beloved Tucker, that gentle lad who took care of us. I stumble forward and feel my legs give way. I go down onto my knees and stretch my hand out, so far away from Tucker, but I can't help him. Curtis rushes to his side, beating the undead back and hacking away desperately, trying to save his friend. I try to shout a warning as I see zombies rushing Curtis from behind, but my voice is pathetic, weak and dying. Curtis is taken down, his body landing heavily on top of Tucker as they are both ravaged and killed. Malcolm twists back to run at the boys and is taken from the side, going down heavy and swamped by zombie bodies tearing into him. Chris screams and fights back. They all give ground and the circle gets smaller, the zombies pressing in. Pure looks of terror on Blower's and Cookie's faces, Nick crying with shame as he knows they will die. Not like this, 
Please, God, not like this. Don't let them take any more. We were meant to win. We're the righteous and we came so far. These are just boys, brave boys that have fought, and you're letting the evil take my beautiful, brave boys. I lash out with my fist and punch an undead's face. He drops away, and I know I'm only seconds away now. I feel drained and weak, and there's nothing left inside of me, nothing left to use. Why did you do this to me? I told you I would destroy you, Howie. I warned you. You have to help me. You have to give me more anger and rage so I can fight. There's nothing left, Howie. You've used it all up, and it's left you weak and pathetic. Oh, God. Dear God, please, Lord, give me the strength to do this. Give me the strength to rise up and fight. You wanted anger, Howie. You wanted rage and fury and power. Then give me more. It's gone, Howie. There is no more to give. With my head bowed, I wait for them to take me. Our Father who art in heaven, the words come to me, and in final prayer, I hold an image of Sarah in my mind. There it is, Howie. What? There's what? You fool, Howie. It's right there inside you. Take it. Take what? Sarah, that feeling for your family. What is that? She's all I have left. She's my family. What does she mean to you, Howie? What did you feel when you thought of her and said those words? What was that? That was love. Yes, Howie, that was love. Our Father who art in heaven. Yes, Howie, louder. Say it louder. Our Father who art in heaven. I feel something surging through me, a feeling starting so deep and coursing through my system. Yes, Howie, love is the most powerful thing of all. Our Father who art in heaven, my voice starting off weak and choked quickly becomes strong and firm. I look up into the faces of the undead coming at me, teeth bared for the kill. Our Father who art in heaven, I rise to my feet, the axe held in one hand. I stare about at the advancing faces as my voice booms out with strength. The men look to me and I hold their gaze, daring the undead to keep coming. Hallowed be thy name, I feel it. I feel power unlike any before, surging through me. My heart beats faster and faster. My mind is clear, and the strength flows back into my arms and legs. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. They are close now, so close I can feel their breath upon my face. I stare ahead, eyes fixed on my men. The undead want me. I can sense it, but something holds them back. Something makes them weary. The whole field pauses for that second, waiting with bated breath. Faces filled with fear and terror slowly become filled with hope. On earth as it is in heaven, I roar, and my voice carries far as I explode with action, and I am no longer weak and exhausted. I am strong. I have strength, and I whirl my axe around and take many down with one massive swing. My axe flies and spins as I chop down, chop left, chop right, and they keep dropping. Every step I take, they wilt away from me. I slice and hack my way through to my men. Give us this day our daily bread! I swing out and send two undead back to the hell from whence they came. The love flows through me with absolution and each blow is precise, brutal, violent, but necessary. I no longer want them to suffer agonizing pain. I want them stopped, to kill them swiftly and end this suffering. And forgive us our trespasses! I burst through the last line of undead that stood between me and my men. Chris and Clarence step aside and leave a gap for me to take up. I step in and hear as they take up voice with me, Blowers, Cookie and Nick joining in, and our voices are strong. As we forgive those who trespass against us, our combined voices carry and I hear more joining in. Men and women behind us, holding the line, raise their glorious voices and join as we pray loud and with fresh hope we fight on. And lead us not into temptation. For McKinney, we fight on and take them down. New strength flows into us. For the blessed love of Tucker, Curtis and Malcolm, we fight and stand our ground. But deliver us from evil. Our words taunt them. The undead roar with defiance and attack with ferocity, snarling and growling. But we hold them back and cut them down and they fall. 
For thine is the kingdom, they surge on against us, and they fall as we cut them down. Thousands of voices cry out in exalted prayer as thousands of hands wield weapons and cut down thousands of zombies. The living are taken time and time again, but instead of despair we fight as humans have never fought before. This is not just about survival now. This is good versus evil. This is right versus wrong. And the power! Our voices cry louder, carrying all across the battlefield. Little did we know the strength these words would carry, and how they could combine our strength and resolution when we learnt them at school. And the glory! Still we fight on, and the tide is turning. They know it because they attack with more violence and surge into us again and again. Forever and ever we scream out in unison, us, the living, shouting our defiance with glorious words of scripture against the vile, foul things that try to kill us. Again! I hear Dave's voice roar out from somewhere deep within the ranks. I look to the direction and as one we turn and fight towards him as we once more lift our voices and repeat the Lord's Prayer. Dave battles through rank after rank of undead, his body twisting and flexing with incredible speed. The knives started off bright and metallic, flashing as they rip through the air to be tugged against throat after throat. He drops down and severs hamstrings, pausing for a second until the body drops down, and then he digs into the jugular with a short, sharp stab. Pulling away, he leaps up to avoid the mouths lunging forward, arms ready and in position as he plummets back into the ranks of filthy zombies. Gallons of blood spill as artery after artery is opened. Mouth after mouth lunges at him but he steps away with amazing grace. He kills without slowing, and the more he does, the faster he gets. The muscles warm up and his heart increases the flow of oxygen and blood, causing him to shift the physical gear and generate more incredible speed and power. Then something is wrong. A shift in the equilibrium within his mind. He was powering forward, intent on finding Darren and destroying him quickly. Something changes. His connection with Howie makes him pause and turn back. Dave fights with a ferocity that he has never shown before, his arms twirling and spinning, his body dropping and leaning as he searches through the gaps for a glimpse of Howie and the others. The sense of change is palpable and he knows something bad is happening. Howie is threatened and Dave curses himself for moving into the ranks too deeply. With a low growl and a look of pure violence, he powers through zombie after zombie, killing and maiming, desperately fighting back towards his friend. The undead in front of him become dense, as though they are drawn to something. They block his view, and he leaps high to catch a glimpse of Howie faltering and stumbling. His axe swings slow and weak. He pushes on, with fear in his heart, his deadly blades becoming dull-edged from repeated use. He discards them both and uses his arms to grab at zombie neck after zombie neck, twisting with a violent wrench to snap the spinal column. Dave catches another glimpse of Howie dropping down onto his knees and listens as Howie screams out. Dave twists around to see Tucker dead and Curtis being savaged. The undead seem to know Dave is fighting to rescue Howie and they push into him, blocking his path with body after body. In desperation, Dave draws the last set of knives tucked into his belt line and sets to work, slicing jugulars open with frenzied action. Then he hears it, Howie's voice. Weak at first, but then strong, and it carries across to him. The Lord's Prayer is being bellowed out, and Dave catches another glimpse of Howie up on his feet, standing ready, his eyes blazing as the whole world seems to pause. Dave's heart thrills as he watches Howie explode with power, and his voice cries out loud and true. As more voices take up the prayer, Dave pauses and quickly tries to decide which way, back to Howie, or keep going for Darren. Darren has to be stopped. If he is controlling this lot, then taking him down could end this far sooner. With an almost reluctant shrug, he once more turns and starts fighting deeper into the ranks. He listens to the words of the Lord's Prayer booming out in unison. He senses the change in the zombies and watches as they surge faster and quicker. The reaction causes the undead to become more fierce, but Dave notices something else, something that only someone with hundreds of hand-to-hand combat battles would pick up on. The harder they attack, the weaker they become. Something is changing. They are attacking harder than ever before, but it feels easier to drop them now. 
Blows to the head and neck have always cut them down instantly, but body blows are also dropping them now. Deep cuts that would easily down a man but would not affect the undead too greatly are now causing them to fall. We should be getting beaten back now from the ferocity of their attack, but instead, we're not only holding our own, we're gaining ground. They growl and snarl and roar as they attack, driving into us time and again. They are being pushed. Something is pushing them harder. They can sense the change in us. We were almost beaten. We were almost stopped. And they had the taste of flesh by taking Tucker, Curtis and Malcolm. But now, now we rise up and fight so hard that they feel desperate and attack harder and faster. Whatever the thing is inside them, it cannot sustain their rate of energy expenditure for this long. It's simply too much for their decaying and already dead bodies. Dave! I bellow out between axe strikes, desperate to find him. Here! I hear his enormous voice. He is close now, and we push on harder, swinging our axes and cutting down many undead as we plough through them, trying to reach Dave. Dave feels them weakening with each blow. Whereas he focused on the neck and head for each killing move before, now he senses their weakening state, and he takes the risk to use the knives as stabbing tools. He thrusts the blades into the chest cavities. It works, and they start dropping from stabbing thrusts that before would have had no effect. Now he works faster, no longer impeded by the necessity to angle himself to take the throat. He stabs out with increasing speed, puncturing chest after chest. His blows rain out until his arms are just a blur, each arm seemingly working independently, pistons driving the sharpened points of the knives into the soft, decaying flesh. They fall away from him in vast numbers. Each step he takes, he kills and kills. Darren! Dave's parade ground voice bellows out as he plunges into the horde. They close ranks and try to present a solid mass against him. I'm coming, Darren! I am coming to kill you! Dave roars out as his arms spin and drive the knives deep into the chests and throats, puncturing lungs, hearts and brains with each deadly thrust. As the last two drop down, Dave pauses. He sees open ground in front of him and another solid mass of undead ahead. How he bursts through the undead lines to his left as his men cut down the final rows of zombies until they too stand before the open ground and look to the solid mass of undead standing before them. I hear Dave screaming for Darren, and I know we must be close. We drive on, attacking and attacking, ploughing through them until we burst through their lines and I see open ground ahead of me. A quick glance, and I see Dave stood to my right, holding his knives and staring at the solid massed horde. There, right in the middle, stands Darren. He has surrounded himself with the biggest and strongest undead. I can see they have been held back. The battle still rages behind us, the people from the fort still reciting the Lord's Prayer, but they feel distant now. For here, in front of us, is the leader of the undead army. Dave! I shout over, to alert him where we are. I see you, Mr. Howie, Dave replies. The men behind me cut down the final few undead and then spread out into a line, facing the horde protecting Darren. We stand with chests heaving, dripping blood and gore from every inch of our bodies. Our faces are smeared with filth, but we live, we breathe air, and our hearts pump living blood through our veins. I lock eyes with Darren Smith. He stands in the middle of his undead bodyguards, and he looks terrible pale and drawn with a sickening pallor, red bloodshot eyes stare back at me. His brow drops, and the feeling of hatred he projects at me is tangible. My mind races with what to say, a smart comment, something witty and inspiring. This is not the time for words, though. All that needed to be said has been. The corner of my upper lip curls up, and I feel a growl growing in my throat. My whole body pulses with energy, living energy. I feel more alive in this second than all of the seconds in my life combined. That, I know, must be driving him crazy. His face twitches, and his whole body twitches. Whether this is from the utter rage within him, or the side effects of the filthy infection in his system, I do not know. They outnumber us, and they are big, mean-looking zombies. Every one of them stands motionless, staring back at us. 
Darren's gaze shifts to Dave and he stands, staring at the small man holding a knife in each hand, the blades turned up against his forearms. Several of the undead bodyguards suddenly detach themselves and move away towards Dave. They stop and reach their arms around to pull knives out. Each of them holds a deadly looking blade. I count eight big, nasty looking zombies holding knives. Take him, Darren growls softly, and they start moving towards Dave. I turn towards him, but Dave holds a hand up to stop me, his eyes never leaving the pack of knife wielding zombies coming towards him. I watch closely as Dave stands stock still. He adjusts his position slowly. One foot moves back and he lowers his body a few inches. His left arm comes forward and he holds it across his chest. The right arm pulls back slightly. Then he does something that Dave rarely does. He smiles. A small, wry smile that grows into a big grin that lights his face up. His eyes blaze. At last, some decent competition, Dave mutters quietly. The knife-carrying zombies spread out to form a rough circle around him. Dave in turn remains motionless, apart from his eyes shifting left and right and picking up their positions. Take him! Darren spits the words out and they rush in as one. Movement catches my eye off to my left, and I glimpse Jamie moving around to try and get behind the horde in front of us. Dave holds his static position until I fear he's just going to wait to be cut down. Then, at the very last second, he takes two steps and leaps high over the undead man in front of him, twisting his body so that he lands facing the undead man's back. The zombies rushing in all collide as their momentum drives them into each other. Dave shakes his head once and stabs his knives forward into the zombie's neck, sawing viciously, and the first one goes down. Dave steps back as they recover and rush at him. After that, it's just a blur of arms spinning and twirling. I hear the clang of metal against metal a few times. Grunts and growls sound out as Dave punishes them without mercy. He is in the middle somewhere, and I know he is still alive, as every few seconds a knife-wielding zombie staggers away to fall to the ground with blood spurting out of his open jugular. Go! Dave roars out from the middle of his knife fight. The order clearly is intended for us, and we respond instantly. Gripping our weapons tight, we charge forward. Take them! Darren screams out, and his bodyguards burst towards us. The vain wanker should have given them weapons too. His belief that firstly, we'd never get this close to him, and secondly, that Dave was the only one that posed a threat to him. Well, his vanity, or the vanity of whatever it is inside him, will be his undoing. These undead coming at us are big, strong and full of rage. A guttural roar sounds out and I see a long-handled double-bladed weapon spinning through the air. It embeds deep in the chest of a zombie and he goes flying backwards. Clarence, still roaring, sprints ahead, his hands now empty and, like Dave, he now has some fair competition so chooses to fight on equal terms. Fuck that, I mutter as I charge in, gripping my axe tighter in case I get a sudden urge to throw it at someone. Clarence powers into them, his massive arms punching out left and right, his elbows flying back to smash the noses and cheekbones of undead zombies that are trying to bite him. He picks a zombie up bodily and throws it hard at two more coming at him. I snap forward and swing my axe out hard, biting into the neck of one running at me. His momentum drives me backwards and I fall to the floor as he staggers past me, my axe stuck in his neck. I jump up and clamber towards him, desperate to retrieve my weapon. Strong hands grip me and I get flung like a rag doll through the air, landing several metres away. The zombie that threw me comes on, his teeth bared and growling like a dog. I scamper backwards and get to my feet. Fuck it, I growl back at him and charge. We collide, but I scrabble around and jump onto his massive back, wrapping my arms round his thick neck and squeezing with every ounce of my strength. He staggers about, his arms flailing, but his sheer size prevents him from being able to reach around and pull me off. He slumps down onto his knees and throws himself backwards, trying to squash me under his enormous weight. I squeeze and squeeze with everything I've got as I feel my breath being crushed out of me. My hand is across his face and I move it up slightly to avoid his gnashing teeth. I feel the soft pressure of an eye socket and drive my thumb in hard. 
He squirms and howls as I drive my thumb in, pushing against the resistance of the pressured eyeball. It pops, and I feel warm, sticky goo spurting out over my hand. I increase the pressure with my arms and hold on for dear life until eventually he goes limp. I push him off and wriggle out, running back to grab my axe. I wrench it free from the neck it's stuck in and run back to the fat nonce that tried to squash me. I lift the axe high over my head and drive it down into his skull, bursting it apart, and the dirty grey matter explodes out over the blood-soaked ground. I spin around and swing the axe into the next one coming at me, stepping to the side so I don't get mown down again. I cut deep into his shoulder and he goes down onto the ground. I pull the axe back and chop down at his still-moving body, taking his head off. Another one coming from my right. I grab a fistful of hair and lift the decapitated head and throw it hard. It hits the oncoming zombie square in the face and I almost chuckle at the thought of the headbutt. It stalls him for just a second, but it's enough for me to step around and slice the axe into his leg, cutting through to the bone. He goes down and again I chop down viciously, taking his head off. I hear a scream and spin round to see Jamie launching himself at several undead still standing with Darren. His knives do deadly work and drop several, but his skill isn't the same as Dave's, and suddenly he's gripped by an undead on either side. Jamie thrashes and kicks out, but like Dave, he's small, and his blows go unnoticed. Darren runs over and drives a knife deep into Jamie's stomach. Jamie screams and thrashes. Darren goes around behind him. I roar out and start running, but Darren smiles at me as he pulls Jamie's head back and sinks his teeth deep into Jamie's neck. All of us see it. Me, Dave, Blowers, Cookie, Nick, Chris and Clarence, and we scream out and charge forward. Darren laughs and steps away. The remainder of his bodyguards charge at us, as Darren turns to sprint. The bodyguards throw themselves at us with ferocious attacks, and it takes several minutes to finish them off, by which time there is no sign of Darren. I look over and see Dave running to the limp form of Jamie, gasping for breath. I rush over and slump down. Dave rolls Jamie onto his back, and I see the ragged wound in his neck, blood pumping out. Jamie is still alive, albeit barely. The rest join in, shouting to each other and asking where Darren went. One by one, they drop down, and we form a kneeling circle round Jamie. Each of us reaches forward and places a hand on his body. Jamie grips Dave's hand as Dave stares down with an intense look. I reach up and push Jamie's hair away from his eyes. He looks at me and smiles, the young, quiet lad who followed Dave with heroic worship. Did you get him? Jamie whispers at me. We will, Jamie, I swear it, we will, I whisper back. Jamie looks at his hero, and I see tears falling down Dave's cheeks. Don't cry, Dave, Jamie whispers, his breathing becoming shallower. Dave leans down and places a hand on Jamie's forehead. You did good, Jamie, very good. I'm proud of you, Dave says in a voice so soft. Jamie smiles once at Dave, his face lighting up with the praise from the man he worshipped. Then he's gone. The life drains from his eyes and his face falls slack. Hot tears fall down my cheeks as I watch Dave gently reach out and close Jamie's eyes. I reach my hand out to Dave's shoulder, knowing what must be done. Dave looks at me and nods. Chris's hand covers mine and I hear him speak softly. He was one of yours. I'll do it. Dave and I lock eyes for a second. We both bow our heads. Bye, Jamie, mate. See you on the other side. I whisper and move away. Blowers and Cookie drop down and I hear them whisper their goodbyes. Nick goes next, until Dave is left holding Jamie's hand. Then, gently, so gently, Dave reaches down and softly kisses Jamie on the forehead. A sob breaks out from Cookie and I see him drop down onto his knees. Blowers reaches a hand down to Cookie's shoulder and I move over to them. Nick stares back for a second before Dave joins us. We turn away as Chris does what needs to be done. Without Darren, the dead army slow and become the normal daytime shuffling zombies. What's left of the men from the fort make light work, and before long, 
The ground is filled with thousands and thousands of zombie bodies. I look down towards the fort and realise we've lost many during the battle. Of the several thousand that charged out of the gates, maybe a thousand remain. The losses are huge, but we knew what we faced, and we did so as free men. Standing here, now, in the midst of the carnage, I think back to the losses that we as a group have suffered. McKinney, Tucker, Curtis and Jamie. Each of them so unique and so brave. Young men who survived something so truly terrible, yet they laughed and joked and made that decision to fight back. I look over at Chris, Clarence standing by his side, just the way Dave is always at my side, and he too must be thinking of the people he has lost, and I know losing Malcolm will be hitting him hard. For all our losses, though, we've gained something special. Those brave men that laid their lives down did so knowing they were giving humanity another chance. For that, I am thankful. Darren has escaped, but I already know from the looks in the eyes of my men that we won't stop until we find him. Now, though, there is much to do. Bodies need to be burnt, injuries need to be tended. We need to find the children and their mothers and bring them back to the safety of the fort. Most of all, we can do something we've needed to do since this war began we can grieve. That was The Undead, Day 7. Written by R. R. Haywood. Read by Dan Morgan. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program. The Undead, Part 4. Day 8 to Day 9. By R. R. Haywood. Read by Dan Morgan. The Story So Far. Howie and his group fled from London to the safety of the fort on the south coast, while Darren led his army of undead towards them. On the seventh day, every man, woman and child worked ceaselessly to prepare for the attack they knew was coming. There were thousands of undead, in thick ranks that stretched back as far as the eye could see. Many were killed by the housing estate blown up by Dave and Jamie. More were killed by the traps put in place, but many more survived. And as the last bullet was fired by Nick, so the survivors went out to meet the walking dead. The battle was hard and nearly lost. Howie was on his knees, and, fearing all was lost, he recited the comforting words of the Lord's Prayer, and those words were heard across the length and breadth of the battleground. They gave hope, and that hope gave strength, and a hidden reserve of energy swept through the living as they finished the undead. Darren survived, and after killing Jamie, he fled the battlefield. But there is a new danger. Before the battle, Howie ordered the children and those unable to fight to be taken away by boats into the sea, taken away to safety, to be hidden until the battle was done. The battle is finished, but with Darren surviving, are those children safe? The Undead continues. 1. Day 8. Friday. All around me is death. We stand on the battlefield, our small group now greatly diminished, and try to absorb the shock of our terrible losses. Tears stream down the faces of Cookie and Nick, making small, clean trails down their blackened faces. Blowers looking stony-faced and hardened stares down at the ground. I look over and see Clarence resting his hands on the end of his double-bladed axe. Mine hangs limply down at my side. I look down the shaft and see the still wet blood, gore and filthy pieces of one's human body stuck to the blade. Chris stands resolute as ever, feet planted apart and hands resting on his hips. Only his face betrays the feelings of loss and exhaustion. I look past them to the mounds of bodies and the now shambling undead still being hacked down. The sight offends me. Too much death has taken place here today. Too much suffering but I know it must be done, and for the first time since this began, I let someone else do it. Let them take out their anger and hurt on those rotting walking corpses. As I scan round, my gaze comes to rest on Dave, who is staring at me intently. The two knives are now tucked back into his waistband, and he stands easy, relaxed. His breathing is already back under control, and other than the filth that encrusts him, as it does all of us, he looks the same as ever apart from the puzzled expression on his face. You right, Dave? I ask him. He nods and turns his head away. But within seconds, he glances back and stares again with that puzzled expression. 
What? I exclaim, shrugging my shoulders. Nothing. He looks quickly away again. Dave? I ask him. Something is on his mind. What is it? He looks at me for long seconds, then repeats my actions and shrugs his shoulders. Nothing. Just tired, Mr. Howie, he says, finally. That's a lie. Dave doesn't get tired. But I am. I'm bone weary and I let it pass. Whatever it is can wait until he's comfortable enough to tell me. What now? Clarence rumbles quietly. I wait for Chris to respond, but he just stares out towards the area where Malcolm fell with Tucker and Curtis. Clear the bodies. Use those diggers maybe to scoop them up and burn them. Other than that, we need to go after Darren. Find where the boats went and bring them back, I say quietly. I don't know what your thoughts are, Chris, but after what you did in the commune, I think you're the best one to stay and run this, I add, looking over at him. He nods back at me, making brief eye contact. Okay. His voice is hoarse and deep. Howie, if you want to go after Darren, I'll go after the boats, Clarence offers, knowing I'll be torn between the two. You okay with that? I ask Dave. Yes, Mr. Howie, he nods back at me. Lads, I look to Blowers, Cookie and Nick. I'm with you, Blowers says, flatly, without shifting his gaze from the ground. Me too, Cookie adds. Nick? You don't have to ask, Mr. Howie, he replies, his tear-filled eyes locking onto mine with an intense look in them. Okay, I address them all. Nothing more needs to be said. I turn and stare back towards the still smoking remains of the housing estate, blackened stumps of buildings poking up in irregular shapes. We'll find him, Dave says, giving voice to my thoughts. We need to go then, I say. Not now. He's already dead and so will we be if we go anywhere near that estate for a few hours. We'll find him. He'll leave a trail wherever he goes. I stare on in silence. Mr. Howie. We need to clean ourselves up, take fluids and food and rest. We will find him. Dave steps forward, clearly intent on making me listen to him. Okay, I say again. It's about all I can manage right now. I look round to see a woman striding towards us. One by one we all turn to stare at her as she crosses the field, stepping over and on the bodies. Who's that? I ask. The engineer woman, Dave replies. Kelly? I don't know, Mr. Howie, Dave says. Yes, Chris adds. We stand and watch her walk towards us. Her gait is strong and confident. She holds a long-bladed machete in her right hand. She watches us watching her, and she only stops when she's a few metres away. Gentlemen, she nods towards us. Her voice is strong too. We nod back. Nobody speaks. Are any of you injured? she asks. Dr. Roberts sent me out to check. We shake our heads, mumble that we are unhurt. Are there many injured? I ask. Many, she nods. They're stacked up. We'll come and help. I step forward. She doesn't move. No, you won't. You've done enough. All of you, go inside and rest. I'll get things underway here. I take it you want them all burned? Yes, but I don't know how we'll do it. Dig pits, I guess. Or use the deep ditches and whatever fuel we've got left. Thank you, Mr. Howie. I'll take it from here. Now go inside. A command, not a request. I look at Chris. He shrugs and starts walking towards the fort. I shrug at Clarence and start to follow him. We walk in silence, stepping over and on the bodies, taking a detour to avoid the last of the slow-moving zombies still being cut down. We enter the fort and the emptiness and silence greets us like a smack in the face. The fort looks much bigger without all the people inside. Some of the tents and structures are blackened from fire. We walk through the compound, keeping to one side and heading for the planning office. As we walk further in, I see people sitting, lying and standing in long queues outside the field hospital. The more able-bodied go up and down the lines, giving water and words of comfort to the injured. A quick glance tells me most of them have been hurt by their own weapons or have suffered broken legs and twisted ankles. We pass through them quickly. The whole area goes quiet as we walk through. They stare hard at us. I can't tell what the looks mean. And at this time, I don't care. 
Someone exits the planning office just as we reach it, glancing at our filthy state before quickly moving away. We pay no heed, but walk straight in and see the cold bottles of water left on the table and the filled buckets on the floor with towels and brushes. We go for the drinks first, each of us twisting the caps off and taking long, noisy gulps, the water spilling down our chins and soaking the front of our clothes. I drain one bottle and go for another. Clarence is already on his third. Dave drinks two bottles, then carries one of the buckets outside into the warm sun. He strips down to his undergarments and starts scrubbing at his body with the brushes. We join in, taking a bucket each, pausing only when we realise there are several more buckets left over. The sadness grips quickly and threatens to pull me down into the earth. We wash in silence, scrubbing the filth from our skin, brushing our hands and arms the most. I realise how much weight I've lost in just one week. My stomach feels flatter. I feel leaner. The result of constant movement and no food. Someone drags a hose out and we take turns to sluice the soap from our bodies in the freezing spray. I drink more water while I wait for my turn. Still, none of us has spoken since we came back in. Dave drags the unused buckets out and starts scrubbing his clothes in them, using the brush to attack the dark bloodstains. We follow his lead and take the time to scrub our own clothes, wringing and spinning them out. I spin my trousers round and round, watching the glistening water spray off like a Catherine wheel. The clothes are spread out in the sun, and eventually we head into the back rooms, slumping into easy chairs, sofas and the few camp beds left in there. I go to the far corner and fall onto one of the camp beds. My mind races for a few seconds, but then there's just blackness. Sweet, empty blackness. 2. That cunt, Howie. He thinks he wins again, but I won't be beaten. The others have become weak and frail, dropping like flies as the sun grows strong and hot. But I'm not like them. I'm not weak. I know that biting that little prick Jamie will slow them down. They'll stop to cry like babies while I run away. That's the difference between them and me. I won't let feelings get in the way. We were so close, but I should have been better prepared. I won't make that mistake again. I sense the other hosts becoming weaker. It was like a change within them all. Howie was almost beaten. I saw him go down, and I knew I was close to winning. I even held them back from him so I could have the joy of killing him slowly. He was weak and slow. And then something happened. He got strong and started fighting back. The stupid fucking cunt found some hidden reserve of strength. Fuck knows where he got it from. Then he rallied them with that prayer. I sent them in stronger. I willed them to fight harder, and they did. But the sun was strong, and pushing them all day yesterday and all through the night made them weak and their strength just seeped away. Now I know they're being cut down as they stumble about. Fuck them. A massed attack didn't work, so it's time to try something else, and having a fucking zombie army with me will slow me down. The urge to eat flesh is so fucking powerful. Biting Jamie was the biggest buzz I've ever had. Like a thousand orgasms at the same time. Knowing how he and his cunt runt Dave saw it just made it better. Even my zombie cock got hard. The taste was unbelievable and the feeling of his hot, fresh blood pumping into my mouth. Fuck me. I want more. I want so much more. Flesh won't sustain me though. I need fuel to stay alive otherwise I'll get weak like my poor brothers and sisters out there getting slaughtered. Fuck them, stupid cunts. I run through the estate thinking about the battle. I know exactly where I went wrong. A frontal attack was too much and I left it too long. Cunt runt Dave blew up that fucking estate and then some cunt dug ditches and put sharp spikes down. Then they had guns firing at us. But I knew they would run out soon and we still had thousands left. But that prick Howie, he whipped them up and got them ready to fight. I bet he made a stupid speech with stirring words while standing heroically on top of the Saxon, Dave watching him with his little cock standing to attention. I didn't see many women, though. That bitch Sarah wasn't there. I wanted her so badly. So fucking badly. I wanted to bite her fucking tits off while Howie begged me to stop. Fuck it, she must have been in the fort with all the other women and children. No, Howie wouldn't risk it. He expected to lose. I could sense they all did, and he wouldn't leave the women and children on their own, undefended, ready and waiting for us to take them. 
biting into their succulent flesh and tearing their skin apart. How he would have sent them away, hidden them somewhere. There was nowhere left to go. The urge for flesh is so strong, but I must wait. I'm out of the estate now, I'm running back along the lane. There's houses up here. I'll get in one of them and find food. The thought of eating anything other than human flesh makes my stomach churn, but I have to eat. Where did Howie send them? He must have sent them somewhere. Think, Smithy. What would Howie do? I reach the end of the lane. There's a cottage here. The front door is open and I go inside. No one home. I'd smell them if anyone was here. That'd be too much to ask, wouldn't it? Just a little old lady left on her own ready for Smithy to have his lunch. Ah, fuck them. In the fridge is cheese and sour milk and butter and vegetables. I need flesh. I open cupboard doors in the pantry, just fucking tins of peaches. Fuck it, I need flesh, not fucking peaches. I throw the tin and it smashes through the window into the back garden. Another noise, scampering, coming from outside. I open the back door and I look down at the fluffy white bunny with giant ears, nibbling at the grass. Hello, my pretty. I move forward and stroke the fur, soft and warm, velvety ears and almost blue eyes staring up at me. Fuck it, flesh is flesh, and I bite down into the soft back. The rabbit squirms, but I bite through the spine and feel the hot blood spurt into my mouth. I lift the warm corpse up and savage at the meat, tearing the flesh off and swallowing it down. It's not the same, but it'll do for now and I need fuel to survive. I drop the corpse and stand up. The warm blood is dribbling from my mouth and I lick my fingers clean. I can still taste Jamie on my hands and I lick them harder, desperate to get the last lingering flavour. Where did Howie send the women, little white bunny? The corpse doesn't answer, just lays there bleeding. Something triggers. White bunny, the fort at the water's edge with nowhere left to go. White bunny, white. I smile. I know where he sent them. How he wouldn't keep them anywhere close. I oh, know he knows I'd find them. There's only one place left after here. My smile becomes a grin as I walk out of the back garden. I need a boat. Three. Waking up quickly, I sit bolt upright with sweat pouring off me. The room smells of farts, and even though we washed before we came in here, it also smells of stale body odour. Blowers and Cookie are still passed out, sleeping deeply. Chris is lying on one of the camp beds, flat on his back, snoring loudly. I stagger outside to find it's still daylight. I check my watch. It's just gone 1pm. We slept for a few hours. Dave is sorting the clothes out, folding them into piles. Morning, Dave. First word since I woke up and my voice sounds gruff. It's afternoon, Mr Howie, he replies. I know it's a figure of speech, mate. Oh, I always wondered why people said that. Is he being sarcastic? No way of telling with his flat way of speaking. We need to get going, I say to Dave. You, Mr Howie, are relentless, Clarence says, approaching from the direction of the hospital and carrying several bottles of water in his massive hands. He hands me a bottle. I twist the cap off and drink it down. My mouth feels furry with a metallic taste. Where do you think he'll go? He asks as I tilt the bottle up to my mouth and lean back. I watch the bubbles shooting through the water in the bottle as I gulp it down. He'll be somewhere close. He wants to destroy us, so he'll be waiting for a chance, I reply. You think so? Clarence says. You saw what he did to Jamie. The look on his face. He was getting off on it. He really doesn't like you, does he? Chris says from the doorway, yawning and stretching his arms out. Do you think so? Damn, and there's me thinking we were best mates, I say. Anyone been outside yet? Chris asks. Not me, I reply. Dave shakes his head. I didn't go out, but I checked in at the hospital. The bodies are being scooped up into piles ready to be burnt, Clarence says, looking down at the ground. What about the bitten ones turning? Chris asks, scratching his bushy beard. They've got a few people with weapons, taking them out as they come back. 
My stomach knots as I think of Tucker and Curtis coming back as one of those. I can see Chris thinking the same about Malcolm. What's done is done, Clarence says with finality. We move on. Let's get after him then. I take another swig of the water. Why not rest for a bit? If you think he's close, then let him come to us. We're safe in here while Clarence goes after the boats, Chris offers in his normal diplomatic way. The idea is tempting, very tempting. I'm sure Darren won't go far. His hatred for us, well, me, is intense, and I believe he will do anything he can to get at us. The risk of going out there with no ammunition left for the guns and only hand weapons left, well, it's a big risk. We've got no ammunition left. I give voice to my thoughts. Shotguns. We got loads of them. We didn't use them on the wall. The range was too great, Clarence replies. Sidearms too, Dave says. Sidearms? Handguns. There were no use from the wall either. We've got a few in the Saxon, Dave explains. I gave Ted a couple yesterday too. So we're still armed and dangerous then. What do you want to do? Chris asks, swiftly moving on from my feeble attempt at humour. I look at Dave, but his face, as normal, gives nothing away. Coffee. That's what I want to do. I rub the sleep from my eyes and stretch my aching body. I sent Nick to sort it, Dave says. Sort what? I reply. The coffee. Nick sorting it, he replies patiently. Oh, OK. I need a toothbrush, too. My voice trails off, thinking of Tucker and how he'd have a cooked breakfast sizzling away in pans by now. Toothbrushes lined up and fresh hot towels probably too. Darren Smith. I swear I'll kill him. Kill who? Dave asks me. I realise I must have said that out loud as Chris and Clarence are both staring at me too. Smithy. I swear I'll kill him. This is his fault. The disease, or whatever it is, well, that happened and everyone had to deal with it. But coming after us like that, targeting us, that was different. That was personal, Chris adds, a dark look crossing his face. I keep wondering if we brought it on ourselves with the amount of them we killed over the last few days, I say. No, Clarence says with conviction. Think how many people they've taken. Millions more than that. There can't be a person left on Earth that hasn't been affected by them somehow. They left you alone, though, I retort quickly, thinking back to the commune in London and how little contact they had before we got there. Christ, how it only happened a couple of days before you arrived. They would have come for us eventually, Chris replies almost angrily. You're right, this is down to Darren. He did this, or whatever that thing is inside him. Yeah, I guess. I shake my head and look down at the ground, then realise we're all standing chatting in our underpants. It was only a few days ago that I felt too self-conscious to stand in my parents' kitchen with Dave just in my pants. How the world moves on. Mr Howie, do we have a grievance procedure? Blowers suddenly asks, walking out of the room to stand squinting in the bright sunshine. And what? I ask, confused. A grievance procedure. Under the Employment Act, any employer must have a grievance procedure. I want to air a grievance, he explains. Fucking what? I ask him. Mr Howie, you left me alone in the bedroom area with Cookie and he tried spooning me. Fuck off, blowers, that's disgusting, Cookie retorts from just inside the doorway, standing there with his hand in his pants, scratching his ass. I burst out laughing with a sudden release. This is not funny, blowers continues in a serious tone. I'm more than happy to charge about the country killing zombies and putting myself in constant peril, but I draw the line at being sexually harassed in the workplace. There's laws about that kind of thing, he adds. I shake my head, still laughing. Also, and this is a very sensitive thing to inform you of, Mr Howie, but, uh Blowers crosses his arms across his body defensively and affects a hurt look on his face. Cookie touched me in my private place. Clarence starts laughing, braying like a donkey with his deep tones. Chris is chuckling away and even Dave smiles. Cookie, stop touching blowers in his private place, I call out between bursts of laughter. Yes, Mr Howie, sorry Mr Howie, Cookie shouts back quick as a flash. Is there any coffee? Nick's sorting it, Chris, Dave and I reply at the same time, smiling at each other. When this is over... I'm taking you all to an employment tribunal and I get millions and I'll be able to retire, Blowers says with indignation. 
I would be a witness and go halves with you, but I guess I'm complicit. Chris laughs. I, uh, don't know what that word means, Blowers says to more chuckles. You thick fucker, Blowers, Cookie calls out from inside the room, still scratching his ass. I bet you don't know what it means either, Blowers shouts back. Ah, now that's a sight for sore eyes, I cut in, spying Nick walking back towards us carrying several flasks of coffee. Where's the cups? Blowers asks him. Cups? Dave never said anything about cups, just coffee, Nick says as Dave glances at him sharply. Oh, you've done it now, Dave's going to kick your ass for that, Blowers replies with a sharp intake of breath. Shit, sorry Dave, I didn't mean that the way it sounded. Nick says quickly, still somehow managing to make the word Dave sound like the word Sarge. There's cups inside, just need swilling out. Chris disappears into the dark room and returns, holding several mugs in his big hands. I'm getting dressed, Blowers says, picking up his trousers. I'm not standing around Cookie in my underpants. You're a sick fucker, Blowers, Cookie sighs as he walks outside to wait for the coffee. Ha! Do you remember that bloke on top of the motorway service station? Nick asks. Blowers and Cookie both burst out laughing as Nick pours the coffee. I think he actually shit himself, like proper shit himself, Cookie says. I take it that was something to do with a pair of trousers tied onto the back of the Saxon, I ask. Um, uh, maybe, Blowers replies, the three of them chuckling like old fishwives. I watch them and wonder at their ability to laugh and joke after what we've been through. Their humour is infectious, though, and it's broken the strained atmosphere. Young minds heal quickly, Chris says, looking at me. Squaddy humour, Clarence adds, nodding to himself. We were talking before you came out, I say to the group as we drink the hot coffee. We reckon that Darren won't be far. It's clear he wants to get at us any way he can. They all stare at me, and I almost feel bad for ruining the atmosphere with this serious issue, but it has to be decided now. So we can go out and try to find him, or wait here and see if he comes to us. The fort is strong and he hasn't got an army now. We've got enough people here to put guards up and keep the doors locked, and we've still got vehicles to go out and get supplies. Also, there are other forts along the coast. We should try and make contact with them, see if we can rig up some communication between us. The other important thing is to find the women and children and bring them back. I take a sip of coffee and look at them in turn, inviting them to join in. He's got to pay for what he's done, Blowers says quietly. Definitely, without doubt. But he's expecting us to go charging after him now and expose ourselves. We should wait and see if he comes to us, I reply. What if he doesn't? What if he keeps running and gets away? Cookie asks seriously. He's a twisted psychopath, Clarence cuts in. He gathered every zombie he could find and brought them here trying to get us. He won't leave it now. Where did the boats go? Nick asks. I swore I wouldn't tell a soul where they went, just in case. But I think these men have proved themselves beyond doubt of their trust. The captain was going to try either the forts, the big ones in the sea, or take them over to the Isle of Wight, I explain. The Isle of Wight? Chris replies. I forgot about that. I went there on holiday when I was young. Where is it? Dave asks, and I remember that for all his skills and abilities, he knows virtually nothing of normal life and living, or much about the country either. Across the water. Not too far. Maybe a few miles. Is there a bridge? Dave asks. No. Tunnel? No, nothing. It's a proper island. Boat only. They had car ferries running every day, I explain. And a hovercraft. We went over on the hovercraft, Chris says, clearly reminiscing about his childhood. Dave, you're right, mate. He looks suddenly pale and worried. I don't like boats, he says flatly. We used them all the time in the service, and I hated them, he adds with a rare display of emotion. So you know how to use them then, Chris asks, smiling, and Dave suddenly looks trapped and panicky at the mere suggestion of it. Well, if he knows how to handle them, best man for the job, really. Enjoying seeing the rare sight of Dave looking worried. I never said I could handle them, Dave starts to explain. You said you used them all the time, Chris says quickly. Yeah, but... 
Dave stammers, and my mouth almost falls open at the sight of him desperately trying to think of something to say. I can handle a boat, Nick says, coming to Dave's rescue. I used to go fishing loads. Okay, so what do you think of staying here and letting Darren come to us? I put the question out. Whatever you think, Mr. Howie, Lois says. Cookie and Nick are both nodding. Dave sits bolt upright, an intense look on his face. He'll go after them, he says quickly. What? I ask him. Darren, he'll go after them. He knows we're too well protected here and he knows we expected to lose. So he'll know you would have taken steps to keep them safe. He'll figure it out and go after them. Mate, slow down, I say, struggling to keep up with his logic, but with a sense of panic creeping up inside me. Mr. Howie, Darren knows we expected to lose. There was no way we could have ever hoped to win with the numbers he threw at us. He knows you, Mr. Howie. He knows the effort you took to get Sarah, and he'll know you sent them away so they couldn't be taken when we lost the field. He speaks quickly, forcing his words out. Dave, how? How will he know where they went? Howie. He's right, Clarence says, getting to his feet. I stand up, staring round at their faces. There's nowhere else they could have gone. He'll work it out and go after them, he adds. They're right. There was no way I would let them hide out anywhere around here. The fort was the safest place for miles, and that wasn't even deemed safe enough to keep them. Maybe he'll think they're still here? No. Smithy will know I sent them away. He might be a sick fucker, but he's not stupid. He was clever enough to run away when he sensed they were losing. Anyway, there isn't anywhere near here that could hide several hundred people without being noticed. The estate was rigged with explosives traps, so we couldn't have got them out through there. The sea is the only place they could have gone. Fuck it. Fuck and shit. I spit the words out, angry with myself for sitting here and drinking coffee. Mind you, he's still got to find them yet. Chris offers, once again rubbing his beard as he thinks. It's an island, isn't it? Dave asks. Yeah, it's not small, though. It's got several towns and loads of open places, I explain. If the boats stop running when the outbreak started, the island will be cut off and probably overrun by now. They've only got a few hours head start. If we leave now, we might catch them up, Clarence says quickly, gathering his belongings. Nick... You're now the driver. Get the Saxon down here and ready to go. Blowers, can you go with him and sort out what weapons and ammo we've got left? Chris, did you say there's shotguns here? I turn and ask him. No, I did, Clarence answers. Malcolm had them in the armoury. Chris, is there a metal cutter here? We'll get the barrels taken down to make them more manageable. Will that take long? I ask, concerned at anything that could delay us. Five minutes, Howie, and trust me, it'll be worth it, Clarence replies. I'll get them ready, Chris starts to move off. Chris, I still think you need to stay here. Someone needs to run this place. I saw what happens when the wrong people take charge. It needs someone with leadership. Chris stops and looks first at me, then at Clarence. Makes sense, Chris, Clarence offers. Besides, you're getting too old to run around these days. You cheeky twat, Chris laughs. OK, I'll stay here. He drops the laugh and stares hard at Clarence. Make sure you bring her back. He turns and walks quickly away, heading towards the armoury. Bring who back? I ask Clarence quietly. His wife went in the boats, he replies, staring levelly at me. Fucking hell, I had no idea. The woman in the commune who brought us the drinks, that was his wife? Yeah, I leave Clarence speaking and run after Chris, catching up with him outside the office the police used. Chris! I didn't know your wife went in the boats, I call out. He stopped to turn back and face me, shrugging once. Mate, I had no idea. I'm so sorry. Sorry for what? It's not your fault, he says. Sorry for not realising. There was just so much going on. Howie, it's not your fault. I took steps to protect her and get her away, just like you did with Sarah. But how can you stay here when you know she's out there? Because it needs to be done. And if you, Dave, Clarence and the others can't bring them back, then nobody can. Chris, do you want to go? I can stay here and get the fort up and running again. No, besides, it wouldn't be just you staying, it would be Dave too. Dave would go? I reply with a little confusion as to what he means. Howie, Dave would go if you asked him, and then it would be reluctantly, very reluctantly. You and Dave make a good team. 
There's something special about the way you both operate. Look at what you did just in this last week. I don't think anyone else could have managed that. Don't be daft, you'd have done it the same. I might have tried, but I wouldn't have won the people over like you did. Those young lads respect you, Harry. You're a natural leader, and like it or not, that's your responsibility to deal with. Yet, you could stay here and get the fort running, and you'd do a good job, but you'll do a better job going after them. He starts walking off again. I jog to keep up with his big strides and fast pace. Chris, you've got years of proper army training and missions and stuff. I don't have that. But bloody hell, it's Dave that got me out of most of the messes I got into. We walk into the armory and I follow Chris as he starts picking shotguns up from a stack and laying them on a workbench. But you put yourself into those situations, Howie, when most people would have cowered and hidden away, you went forward. We had a saying in the old days, when everyone else runs away, we run towards. Mate... I get that, but it's your wife, Chris. Fair enough, my sister is out there, but that makes it about even for us, in a manner of speaking. What I'm trying to say is that we've both got the right to go, not just me. We can both get the fort up and running, so it shouldn't be just assumed that because I want to go, I should do... Oh, fuck, I'm not making sense. It makes perfect sense, Chris says, quickly checking each weapon and sorting them into piles. But what you fail to see, Howie, is the way you do things. You and Dave, it's something special. We followed you, Howie. Yet I can lead and I know I'm a good leader and we shared the responsibility of getting ready for the battle. But it was you leading us out there. It was you charging forward on your own. And look at the damage I caused. Tucker, Chris and Malcolm might still be with us if I hadn't charged off on my own like that. No, we would have taken losses. That is normal, Howie. We cannot walk into a fight like that and expect everyone to walk back out of it unscathed. His voice is firmer, rising in volume. Chris, I fucked up. I overextended myself and almost got beaten down. I was fucked and on my knees. And if we'd stayed as a group and kept the circle we used before then, it might not have happened. If, if, if we had more ammunition, if we had more trained men, if we had fucking planes and tanks, if those things hadn't come after us. There's no room for ifs, Howie, Chris shouts, not in anger, but trying to make his point. And yes, you were on your knees, but what happened then, Howie? He stares straight at me, his intense look unflinching. What happened then, Howie, when you were on your knees? He speaks low, eyes locked on mine. I got back up. I shrug, uncomfortable now. How? How did you get back up? I saw you falter and drop. You had nothing left. I've been in many, many battles and fights, Howie, but I have never seen anything like that. You came alive like nothing I've ever seen before. You scared them. Something about you scared them and made them hold back. You were surrounded. They could have killed you a hundred times over in the time you were on your knees, but they didn't. Yeah, well, just lucky, I start to say. Oh no, not lucky. No one's that lucky. Whatever that was, it was different. Special. The whole field responded to you, Howie. Every person on that field heard your voice and the words you spoke. They were just words. Bloody hell, Chris. Howie, how many people were on that field? Chris asks me, his eyes still locked on mine. I don't know. We had a few thousand. They had a lot more. So how did they all hear you? With all the fighting, the shouting, people getting hurt and dying, thousands of people all making noise... How did they hear you? I, I don't know. I was shouting, then you joined in, and then the rest joined in. I guess it just carried. I feel weird. Unsettled. Howie, we all heard you. Every one of us. It was like your voice was inside our heads or something. It was everywhere. E Echo? I try to joke. I don't like the way this is going. Chris shakes his head, finally breaking his gaze and turning back to the shotguns. I've been a soldier all my life and I've never seen anything like that before. Did you not see the way everyone was looking at you when we came back in? They were looking at us. All of us. No, Howie. They were looking at you. Even Dave picked up on it. Do you remember him staring at you at the end of the battle? But then I think maybe Dave saw it long before the rest of us did. Fuck off, Chris, I laugh, trying to joke my way out of it again. What is this? He shrugs again. Ah, enough said. I'm staying here and that's final. You go and you bring them back. 
I'll have the fort back up and running in no time. He turns his back on me, sorting through the shotguns. Chris? Time is ticking, Howie. Darren might already be after them, and you've got my wife to bring back. Okay, mate, okay. There's not much else I can say. I walk out, back into the sunshine and warmth, his words racing and spinning through my mind. I think back to the battle, but to be honest, it feels distant now. It was only a few hours ago, and I can remember every part of it, but not the feeling I had. That feels distant, like something I dreamt or that happened a long time ago. I remember going to my knees and feeling weak, but then I remembered Sarah, and I guess I just found some hidden reserve of strength. I shrug it off, too weird and uncomfortable to deal with. I look up and realise I've walked the wrong way, going back towards the hospital instead of our area. Everyone is staring at me, and I remember what Chris just said. Morning, I call out cheerily, stopping mid-stride, knowing I've got to turn round and go back the way I came, but I'll look even weirder if I do that. Ha! <laughs> I went the wrong way. What a donut! I turn and walk back the way I came, my face stinging from the almightily stupid comment I just made. Idiot. Bloody idiot. Walking back, I see the Saxon being driven slowly down the ramp leading from the wall. It reaches the bottom and moves carefully through the camp, coming to a stop just outside our rooms. Dave opens the back doors and climbs in, quickly sorting through the various storage lockers. Blowers and Cookie help lift bags out of the rear doors and onto the ground. Nick comes round from the driver's side and starts opening them up. It's a shame to lose the Saxon, Mr Howie, Dave remarks as he opens the canvas bags. Well, there's a vehicle ferry, but I doubt very much of it's running, and besides, we haven't booked, and it can get pretty busy this time of year, I reply, watching him remove black handguns from the bags and lay them out on the floor. Do we need to book? Dave asks. Have you got the number to call? I was joking. I crouch down and pick one of the handguns up. So was I, Dave remarks flatly. Have you ever used a handgun before? Oh, yeah, all the time, every day on the ranges at the back of the store. I'll take that as a no, then. Have any of you used one before? Dave asks the three lads who are standing watching him. They shake their heads. Grab one each, quick run through and we'll practice later. The safety is here, the magazine goes in here. To engage the first round you slide the top back like this. Dave runs through a lightning fast drill. It seems easy enough. There's enough belt holsters there but only two shoulder holsters. Oh, I've got to have a shoulder holster, Cookie says excitedly, lunging forward to grab one. He stands back up and looks at me. Uh, do you want it, Mr Howie? He asks with a hopeful look on his face. No, mate, you crack on, it'll suit you better. Dave, who's having the last one? I see Nick grinning like mad, glancing between Cookie and the rig in Dave's hands, not realising that Blowers has already picked up a belt holster and is fastening it on. I think Nick might want it, mate. He's almost drooling at the moment, unless you want it. No, I prefer the belt rig. He throws it over to Nick, who gives a loud shout of yes, and starts trying to shrug into it. You'll be there all day. Stand still. Clarence comes up behind him and starts adjusting the straps, fastening them round his shoulders and showing them both how to fix them on. Two magazines each, that's all we've got. Use them as a last resort only. Shotguns and hand weapons first, got it? Dave gives the instructions clearly. I fasten a belt to my waist and slide the handgun into it. We'll leave the Saxon here and use some of the vehicles to find a boat. We can always find something on the other side if we need to. Right, you ready? They all stare back at me, nodding. Get bottles of water from the stores and get some food to eat on the way. We'll meet in the armoury, five minutes. We break apart, the three lads heading to the stores area while Dave, Clarence and I walk down to the armoury, entering to find Chris pushing the long barrel of a shotgun sideways through a circular saw, bright red sparks showering high and cascading across the workbench. Clarence nudges my arm and indicates a load of shotguns already shortened. I go over and pick one up. The weight feels a lot different to the big cumbersome things Dave and I used before. They're all the same bore, that lot, so you can share cartridges. The range is reduced a lot, but the firepower at short range is devastating, which is why, gentlemen, they are illegal, so don't let any police catch you with them. Chris walks towards us, rubbing the end of the shotgun with some wire gauze, smoothing the end off from the action of the saw. 
pistols, sawn-off shotguns and axes. What more can an elite zombie killing unit need? I joke, staring at Chris, thankful that he smiles back. The tension from the conversation we had a short time ago is gone. I shrug my rucksack off and push the shotgun inside, the stock poking out the top. I sink the elastic round the shotgun and put the bag back on. Reaching over, I can just reach the top of the shotgun. Chris steps forward and tightens the straps, lifting the bag higher on my back. I try again and find I can reach the stock easily. I step away and try drawing it out. The trigger guard catches on the elastic. Chris again steps forward and loosens the elastic slightly. Try again, he says. Clarence and Dave are both watching me, seeing if it will work. I reach back and pull the gun smoothly out of the bag. Do it again, Chris says, helping me guide the shotgun back into the bag. I try several more times, pulling slightly from the left and right. The shotgun slides out easily each time. It should be okay, but if you're in a tight spot and it sticks, just ditch the bag. Don't stand there fucking about dancing on the spot, Chris advises me with a smile. You know me too well, mate. That is exactly the sort of thing I would do. Clarence and Dave both insert their shotguns into bags. Dave reaches his easily enough, but Clarence's massive shoulders prevent him from reaching his arm far enough back. You fat fucker, Chris laughs. I can't imagine anyone else saying that to Clarence and getting away with it. For yourself, Chris, you're not exactly little yourself. Malcolm was always telling you to stop lifting so many weights, Chris says, watching Clarence dance about, stretching his arm back but getting nowhere near the stock. Should have listened to him, Clarence rumbles. It's not going to work. I'll leave it there, though. I've got the sidearm and the axe with me. That is, if you can get your fat sausage fingers through the trigger guard, Chris laughs, then ducks as Clarence launches a dirty rag at him. I smile at the sight and think how similar they are to Blowers and Cookie, the easy banter between them built up over years of living and fighting together. We should go, Dave interrupts, clearly impatient to be off. The man's a machine. Clarence jokes and grins at Dave, who remains stony-faced as ever. Outside, we meet up with Nick, Blowers and Cookie. They hand over bottles of water and food items sourced from the stores. They look downbeat and quiet. What's up? I ask. The stores, Blowers replies quietly. Tucker did a great job of getting them in order and it felt weird going through it all, knowing he sorted it, Cookie says. Yeah, I know. He was an exceptional man. We've got to go. You ready? They nod back, still quiet and withdrawn. We head down through the fort to the first gate, Chris walking with us. There are people milling about, walking around quietly. Most of them still in a daze from everything they've been through. There are men crashed out sleeping, some of them still covered in filth and gore from the battle. A few patrol the top wall or lean on the parapets, relaxing and staring out with expressionless faces. Chris eyes them all, taking it all in, and I can tell he's making mental notes as to what needs doing first. Reaching the gates, we head through the single walkthrough one and into the space between the inner and outer wall. We walk down to where the vehicles are stored. There's an old minibus van here, big enough for six, unless you want to take two smaller vehicles, Chris says. We reach the vehicles and I notice the large plant machinery is gone. The diggers we used to dig the ditches are gone too. They must be outside piling the bodies up ready to be cremated. We'll take the van so we can stay together, I reply. Chris sorts through various keys. Each set has been thoughtfully attached to a small label with the make and registration number. I bet Sergeant Hopewell got that done, I remark. At least we know they're in good hands. Yep, for now... Any idea where they would have headed to? Chris asks. We'll try the forts on the way. We've pretty much got to go past them. Other than that, no idea. It's quite a big group, so we'll look for places that are fortified and can hold large numbers. Are there any of these forts over there? Chris nods backwards as though indicating the fort behind him. Probably. Must be, I guess. The plan was for the whole section of water between Portsmouth and the island to be covered by defences. We've got this one and others over here, and the big things in the sea, so there must be some over there. I'd try them first, Chris says, handing over a set of keys. That four-wheel drive is in the way. I'll shift it if you bring the van out. I take the keys, leaving the others where they are while Chris moves the other vehicle. The minibus is an old taxi company vehicle, the firm's logo still etched onto the side. 
advertising the cheapest rates, airport runs and 24-hour cover. The logo makes me think of the planes that would have been in the air at the time it started. Did they land safely? It's midsummer and people would be going away for their holidays. I imagine landing in some gorgeous tropical heaven, only to find it infested with zombies and having no way of getting back. The minibus starts first time, well maintained despite the high mileage illuminated on the dash. I drive forward and pull up just in front of the double gates, now closed and secured after the battle. Two men stand there holding shotguns, watching us with interest. The others take turns to shake Chris's hand and then load in from the big sliding door on the side. Dave goes to take the front, then realising Clarence will struggle to get into a seat, he nods at the big man and gets into the back. Good luck, Chris says, shaking hands. You too, mate. I get in and hear Chris call over to the two men at the gate. They pull the bolts back and start tugging the doors open. I get a flashback of standing here waiting for those doors to open before the battle. I shake my head and drive forward slowly, easing through the gap. I nod at the two men. They're both staring at me. One raises a hand, the other nods. Then we're out, and the scene is amazing. The diggers and plant machinery have been hard at work for several hours under the close supervision of Kelly. Massive piles of bodies have been stacked up in the middle of the flatlands, far enough away from the fort to try and prevent the smoke drifting back. It reminds me of the body piles Dave made in the supermarket. His was neat and tidy. These are just mounds of human corpses. The men doing the work must know some of the people in those mounds. The sight is sickening and turns my stomach. So much destruction and death. There are men moving around one of the mounds of bodies, splashing liquid from fuel cans onto the heaps. They move away to a safe distance. Someone lights something and throws it into the pile. The fuel ignites quickly, and within seconds the mound is engulfed in flames. Thick black smoke billows up into the air. The people on the ground stand and watch the flames. We drive down the central road, heading towards the estate, or where the estate was before Dave blew it up. The smoke drifts over, the stench hitting us despite the windows being closed. I gag in my throat at the smell of roasting meat and use one hand to cover my mouth and nose. The others do the same apart from Dave, who just watches it with idle interest. That's fucking disgusting, Nick exclaims, his voice muffled by the hand clasped tightly over his mouth. We drive on as the men carry the fuel cans over to the next pile and start splashing it out again. I speed up, keen to be away before they light the next one. Within a couple of minutes, we enter the estate, all of us staring around in wonder. The whole area is blackened. Huge pits in the ground show where explosions detonated with the energy forced equally down. Burnt and crisped bodies are everywhere. There must have been hundreds that were incinerated instantly and these came in after. Hardly anything is recognisable. There are twisted, melted lumps that could have been vehicles. The houses are just stumps of brickwork, random walls poking up here and there. The tyres crunch over glass and debris as we drive through in silence, weaving carefully round the larger obstacles. Towards the centre, there is a massive crater and a large void all around it, everything blown away. That must have been the fuel truck, I remark quietly. Dave affirms this with a single quiet, yes. I open the window and poke my head out. The heat is still intense. I guess the stone and brickwork has retained the supercharged heat even from a few hours ago. Again, I speed up, worried about the tyres melting, closing the window quickly, the stench of burning stinging my eyes. Where are we going to get a boat from? I call out. Head to Portsmouth, Mr Howie. There's loads of harbours on the way. Just need to keep to the coastline, Nick shouts back. Right, home, mate. Portsmouth it is. We exit the estate and wait a few minutes before winding the windows down. Blowers pulls the sliding door back to let the air flow through. We all breathe deeply, keen to rid our lungs of the foul and noxious fumes we inhaled. Does anyone mind if I smoke? Nick calls out. Dirty habit, Clarence rumbles from the passenger seat. Do you mind then? Nick asks again. No, you carry on. Anything has got to be better than what we just went through. Clarence turns and smiles at them. In the rearview mirror, I see Blowers, Cookie and Nick shuffling round so they get closer to the open door and window. 
Dave moves over to give them more space. I don't suppose you've got rolling tobacco there, have you? I shout back. Yeah, I've got some, Cookie answers. Do you want one? He sounds surprised. Roll me one, please, mate, I shout back. I didn't know you smoked, Mr. Howie, Blower says. I gave up, then started again, and then gave up. Fuck it, I need something to get rid of that smell. I watch Cookie laying tobacco into a thin white cigarette paper, then deftly rolling it closed. He licks the seam and passes it forward with a lighter. Keep it, Mr. Howie, I've got a few, Cookie says, sitting back down and lighting his own. I ignite the lighter and for a second watch the tiny flame dancing about, glancing between it and the road ahead, thinking of the funeral pyres we just saw. I shrug and lean into the flame, sucking through the cigarette until the end glows bright red. I inhale the smoke into my lungs, holding it there for a second before coughing it out, my eyes streaming with tears, and hear Clarence's deep chuckle. I navigate the small roads, keeping to the coast as much as possible, driving through quiet residential roads that look untouched by the events of the last week. The normality seems to calm our nerves, and it's not long before Blowers and Cookie are exchanging abuse. Nick joining in with them. Being this close to the sea, there are signs of maritime interests everywhere. Small sailing yachts and dinghies in front gardens. Signs for chandlers and sailmakers. Pubs and cafes with nautical names. The lobster pot, the fisherman's rest. The area looks well-ordered and expensive. Big houses that only the elite could afford. Not now, though. If nothing else, the last week has eradicated the class system. Money has been made instantly worthless, and we're back to a base state of being trade, weapons, and who is strong enough to survive. If mankind survives this event, the world could be a much better place in a few years. Cleaner, safer. But that's a big if. And for now, I focus on finding a harbour and a boat. 4. That was lucky. Very fucking lucky. Fortune favours the brave, so they say. Stupid cunts. What do they know about being brave? Fuck all, that's what. I'm the brave one. Being hunted to almost extinction by Howie and his bunch of toy soldiers. Cocksuckers, all of them. I've been running for ages. I was never this fit before I turned. I feel energised, powerful and strong. That's the little snack I just had powering me on. Like I said, I was lucky. The rabbit tasted weird but gave me a bit of energy, but I know I need water too. Just the thought of it makes me want to puke, but it's got to happen if I'm to stay strong and complete my mission. My mission to fuck Howie over properly. I found a shop. Just a small convenience store in the middle of fucking Nowhereville. I could tell there were people inside. The wooden sheets of ply nailed across the windows gave it away. I watched from across the street for a short while and saw an upstairs curtain twitch. A face poked out and looked about. The blind fucker didn't see me, though. I waited until they went away from the window and ran across. The front door had an awning above it, so I got in close, knowing they wouldn't be able to see me from the upstairs windows. Hello? Is anyone there? I knocked and called out, making my voice sound weak and frail. Please, please help me. I knocked again. Not too loud, though. I didn't want them thinking I was trying to break the door down. Just loud enough to make them think I was trying to be quiet. Please, you've got to help. My daughter's been injured. We just need some aspirin to get her temperature down. Please, oh God, please help me. Fuck me, I should get an Oscar for this performance. Noise inside. They're moving about and I can hear low voices. They're discussing whether to help me or not. Please, oh please, I don't want to be out here for long. I promised them I would come straight back. The other shops are all looted and empty. We just need some aspirin and clean water. I give a little sob and knock again. I slump down with my back to the door and my legs stretched out. I know they'll be able to see my feet and know there's just one person. More murmuring from inside, a male and female. I guess from the tones that the female wants to let me in, but the male is arguing against her. My daughter, she's only five. She's been sick. Not bitten, but just sick. I promised I would get some medicine. Oh my God, why is this happening? I promised her I would get some medicine and sweets. I break down, sobbing. Well, pretending to, anyway. We'll open the door, but no funny business. We're armed in here. A gruff male voice called out. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I've, I've got money. Bolts are being drawn back, several of them from the sound of it. I lean my arm against the door frame and tuck my head down, covering it with my other hand just in case I see my face. Just in time, too. The door opens slowly and squinting through the gaps in my fingers, I see a man's face peering at me. Oh, mate, thank you so much. I sob again, heaving my chest a little and rubbing my hand over my face. You're covered in blood, the man says suspiciously. Oh no, it's my wife's. She went out first and got bit. I tried to save her, but she turned and I had to, I had to... I heave my chest again for effect. I just didn't want Rosie to see. I told her to go back inside, but she just kept calling for her mummy. John, open the door and let the poor man in, will you? The female's voice calls out from inside. Okay, come in, mate. It'll be okay. Come inside so I can close this door, you poor bugger. Thank you. Oh my God, I didn't know what else to do. I keep rubbing my face and heaving my chest until I cross the threshold and get inside. There are only two of them, both aged in their sixties by the looks of them. The man is holding a cricket bat and the woman a long knife. The silly bitch puts it down on a shelf next to her when she sees me though. Holding her arms out, she beckons me to her. So I go. I collapse into her embrace and feel her rubbing my back. I hug her back and turn so that I face the man. I feel her tense up as I turn her round. Then the man sees my face and gasps in shock. Edith, let go! He yells, but it's too late. I grin at him and sink my teeth into her neck, biting down hard and tearing into the flesh. The man leaps forward and swings with the bat. I step back and watch him bash his wife round the head. Stupid fucker. Oh my God, Edith! He stares, stupefied, and I grin back at him as we both look down at his now unconscious wife. I chew away for a few seconds and pick a bit of flesh out of my tooth. She's a tough old bird, eh, John? I flick the bit of skin onto the floor. John raises the bat and goes bright red in the face as he lunges at me, taking big swings. I keep stepping back and watch him knocking things off the shelves with the bat. Easy now, John. You're going to have a heart attack in a minute. I step back again as he advances once more, swinging wildly. What's up, mate? Never seen a zombie talk before. He pulls the bat back for a big swipe. I step in and grip him tight, my face inches from his. Come on, John, give us a kiss. I lean in and sink my teeth into his cheek, biting and tearing at the flesh, feeling the hot blood pumping out and spurting into my face. He squirms and thrashes, but the fight has gone out of him, really. He slumps down and I go for the big vein in his neck, biting through it and revelling in the glory. I pull back and press my hand into his wound, stemming the blood flow. Knowing the infection will congeal the wound quickly, I wait for a couple of minutes and let go. The blood pumps out as fast as before. Oops, sorry, John. I bit you a bit hard. I leave him to bleed out. At least Edith can join our glorious undead team now. That was half an hour ago, and I've been jogging steadily ever since. It's amazing, but just that little bit of blood has given me so much energy. I must be a vampire. Ha! <laughs> a zombie vampire. Fuck Twilight. I'm a whole new species. I find a harbour and run in. It's just a small harbour with boats tied up to the floating jetties, fixed in position by solid pylons. I move from boat to boat until I find one with an engine attached. A wooden fishing boat with a small cabin at the front. I examine the controls and figure out how to start it. The engine splutters a few times but eventually fires up. The ropes are pulled off. I press the lever forward, driving the boat into the one in front. What fucking idiot put it there? Cunts. I get the boat away from the jetty and start moving forward out of the harbour and into open water. Little piggies, little piggies, where did Howie send his little piggies? Five. Any ideas which one? We're standing round the front of the minibus, looking down at the harbour we found a few miles out from Portsmouth. Finding one we can use will be the odd bit, Nick replies. Why, are they like cars with keys and alarms? Some are. The smaller ones just take the outboard off. We might be lucky. 
This time of year has people going out all the time. All we need is for some rich bastard to have left his engine attached, Nick explains, his eyes scanning the various boats. He moves forward, the rucksack on his back with the shotgun poking out the top. We must look a right sight. Six men walking through a posh harbour carrying axes and shotguns and dressed in military clothing. Nick goes from boat to boat, checking engines. Clarence seems to have an idea what he's looking for and joins in. The rest of us stand on the pontoon waiting in the warm sunshine. I look down at the gentle waves of the sea, a deep blue colour. The water looks inviting and cool. Small grey fish dart around. White fluffy clouds ride high in the sky, and seagulls glide down to land gracefully on the water. The scene is idyllic. Beautiful. I glance at Blowers and Cookie, both of them silent for once, enjoying the relaxing setting. I look towards Dave and burst out laughing at the already green tinge to his face. The noise makes Clarence stand up suddenly from examining an outboard engine. He follows my look and a big grin spreads across his face. You look like you're about to puke, mate. Do you want some water? I hand a bottle over. He takes it gratefully and starts sipping gently. You really don't like boats, then? No, Mr Howie, I really don't. Oh, yes, my beauty! Nick exclaims loudly. He stands up, grinning like mad. Can you believe some fucking idiot left this here? He clambers out of the black and red-coloured rigid inflatable, big, oversized, inflated frame, seats down the middle behind a central console consisting of a small steering wheel and lever. Two huge, shiny engines at the rear, their mean-looking propellers out of the water. There's a couple of open beer bottles down there, Nick nods towards the front of the boat. I reckon there were people on here when it happened and they legged it. Nice one, mate. Well done. Has it got fuel? I ask him. Hang on. He fires the engine up and moves back to lower the two engines so the propellers are in the water, then goes back and checks the dials. About three quarters full. Mind you, these things burn fuel very quickly. It's not that far, is it? Dave asks, suddenly worried. No, mate, it'll be over in a jiffy, I reassure him. The others climb on, leaving Dave standing there looking like a frightened schoolboy. Eventually, he gingerly steps on and takes a middle seat, his hands grasping the handrail tightly. I dump my belongings next to him and move up front to watch Nick. He examines the instruments for a few minutes, his fingers touching each one in turn, checking and murmuring to himself. He did this on the bridge in London, taking his seconds to figure out a complex set of levers and dials. Got it, he looks up, smiling. Can we let the ropes go? Clarence calls out. Yes, mate, we're ready, Nick answers him. Cookie and Blowers both take seats. Clarence unties the ropes and comes to stand on the other side of the console, both of us watching Nick. Already the tide has pulled us away from the pontoon and Nick lets the boat drift out before gently pushing the lever forward. The engine rises in pitch, only very slightly, and the boat starts moving forward. You're going the wrong way, Nick, Cookie shouts out. Yes, I know, Nick answers, letting the boat move slowly forwards. Nick, Nick, you're going the wrong way, Blowers joins in. Fuck off, Nick shouts back, turning the wheel. The boat responds and starts to turn round, but the next pontoon is close and Nick pulls the lever backwards. Nick, you're going to hit the other boats, Cookie yells. Nick, Nick, you're going backwards, Nick, Blowers shouts, the pair of them laughing. Fucking idiots, Nick mutters, letting the boat reverse slowly, turning the wheel and forcing the nose to face towards the entrance before pushing the lever forwards again. Nick, Nick, Nick. Cookie shouts incessantly. What? You're going really slowly, Nick, he laughs. But the right way this time, Blowers adds. I chuckle at the lads trying to wind Nick up. Mr Howie, is Dave holding on tight? Nick asks quietly. I glance down and see Dave has almost glued his hands to the rails. He's gripping for dear life, I reply. In that case, would you and Clarence please do the same? He smiles evilly, and I see Clarence's knuckles go white as he grips the safety bar. 
Nick eases the boat gently out of the harbour and into the open water. Nick, Nick, you're still going really slow, Cookie shouts out. Hold on, Nick murmurs and pushes the lever forward. The engines instantly scream out and the front of the boat seems to lift high out of the water. The power is incredible and the boat surges ahead. I look back to see Blowers and Cookie falling off their seats and scrabbling for a handhold. Nick turns to look and laughs at the sight of them trying to stand up. He waits a second for them to get a hand grip, then turns the wheel hard over to the side. The boat lurches over and propels forward, causing Blowers and Cookie to go flying off their seats again. Fucking hell, Nick, Blowers shouts out. Nick eases back on the lever and the boat glides to a steady pace. What's that? Nick shouts back. That was fucking great, Cookie laughs. Do it again! No, Dave growls, and the lads go silent as I chuckle to myself. Head for the forts, mate. I point to the two forts out at sea. Both of them are still a few miles out, but clearly visible. Positioned either side of the deep channel, marking the route for the thousands of vessels that pass through every year. Nick eases the lever forward, gently increasing the speed until we're going at a decent pace. The water is calm, like the surface of a pond, and we bounce along with the warm wind blowing in our faces. The noise makes any chance of conversation almost impossible, and we travel in silence. I look round in all directions, no other vessels in sight anywhere. The island looms in the distance looking green and lush, the ground rising steeply away from the shoreline. What's that? Clarence shouts, pointing into the distance. It's a pier, connects to the town, I reply, staring at the long straight black thing stretching out a fair distance into the water. Nick gradually increases the speed with a gentle nudge of the lever. I keep glancing back at Dave sitting there with his eyes squeezed shut. Blowers and Cookie are both facing into the wind, looks of absolute pleasure on their faces. I try to think of what I know about the Isle of Wight. Very little. I know it's big, so finding them might not be easy, but that could make it just as hard for Darren to find them too. But then there's a large group and moving about will attract attention, especially if the police officers and Sarah are armed. My musings pass the time until we're close to the first fort, looming up high above us. We circle round a few times, staring up at the half grey and half black fortress. It looks derelict, with large signs warning the public to stay away. The fort has a mooring point, a metal structure fixed to the side of the building. The gangway leads to a solid-looking gate with a heavy padlock and chain attached. No one has been through there recently, Clarence remarks, standing at the front of the rib and staring at the gate. The waves are more substantial here, the pull of the tide against the fort creating eddies and whirls. Nick fights to keep the boat from being pulled against the fort, making subtle turns with the wheel and the power lever. Try the next one, mate, I say to Nick. He nods and pushes the lever forward, powering the boat swiftly past the fort before turning to move across the main shipping channel. We reach the next one within minutes. This one looks in far better condition with fresh paint on the outside and clear signs of structures running around the top, whereas the previous fort looked flat and featureless. There are windows built into the top section. The mooring point is attached to a more modern looking pulley system and is winched up high, preventing any boats from berthing alongside the smooth walls. We circle round a few times, looking for any signs of habitation or some way of berthing. A gunshot rings out, a loud retort echoing across the quiet sea. We duck instinctively, and I just catch a glimpse of a figure standing way above us on top of the fort, holding a long-barrelled weapon. Dave reacts with lightning speed and whips his pistol out, taking aim at the figure. Dave, no! I shout before he can fire. Nick, back away quickly! Nick starts moving the boat away from the fort. I raise my arms above my head, hands up, trying to show we are not a threat. Although six heavily armed men circling their fort in a high-powered boat can never look that unthreatening. We're going! Please do not fire! I shout towards the fort. Clarence has followed suit and is standing with his arms raised, which just serves to accentuate his massive size. A quick glance back and I see Blowers and Cookie have done the same. Dave has raised his arms halfway, 
but I see his holster is unfastened and ready for quick access. If you come closer, I will fire on you! A loud male voice shouts down, the speaker hidden from view. Okay, we'll stay here. We don't want trouble. We're looking for a large group of friends that came out here in boats. What? I said we're looking for some members of our group that came out this way in boats. I try shouting louder, but my voice is hoarse and doesn't carry that well. I can't hear you. His voice is clear and distinct. Something to do with him shouting down at us, maybe. Dave, you shout up, mate. We are looking for our group that came out on boats early this morning. Dave's voice bellows out, and for a split second, I imagine zombies in Portsmouth turning to face this direction. I saw them, but they are not here. Now go away. What did you see? Go away now, or I will fire. Which way did they go? Another shot rings out. Nick slams the lever forward and we power away quickly. I stare back at the fort and hold my arm up high. Nick raises the speed until we are almost flat out, bouncing along at an incredible speed. He keeps glancing back until he gauges we're at a safe enough distance then powers down to a more comfortable pace. Must be on the island then. The others at the back don't hear above the roar of the engines. Nick and Clarence both nod back. Any idea where? Nick yells out. Head over towards the pier and we'll move along the coast, see if we can find their boats anywhere. I motion with my hand at the same time. Clarence gives a thumbs up as the boat is turned. The adrenaline eases off, but the incident has left a stark reminder of just how dangerous this world is now and how desperate people will be to protect what they've got. 6. The fucking tide is going out. I can't get the boat close to the shore and end up getting it stuck on a sandbank about half a mile from the beach. I ditch the boat and start wading through the water. It doesn't take long before I'm splashing through ankle-deep seawater and then onto the hard, compacted sand. There's a big pier off to my right and the long golden beach stretches off far to my left before disappearing round a bend. I've been able to tap into the eyes and ears of my fellow brethren before, but I can't do it now. I was connected to all of them intrinsically, but it feels like the connection has been broken. I keep trying, but nothing gets through. Maybe it'll come back when I make contact here. There must be some of my brothers and sisters here somewhere. Little piggies, little piggies, Smithy is here for you. Singing the words over and over, I get to the soft sand and walk towards the high concrete wall running the length of the beach. Howie's little piggies must have left some signs of where they went. Maybe there's another smithy here. A super zombie like me. Connected to all his own undead like I was. (laughs) Ha! Like a franchise or something. I get the south coast and this fucker will get the Isle of Shite. Fuck him. I'll kill him and take over. Might be a girl super zombie though. Fuck it, I'll kill whoever it is. Cunts. Dirty fucking cunts, trying to make me be a slave zombie. I'm not a fucking slave zombie. Who do they think they are? Fucking outrageous. It's not right trying to make me take orders. I give orders, I don't fucking take them. They're dead, whoever they are. They can suck my zombie cock if they think they can rule me. I step through a gap in the wall and onto the promenade. It looks nice, clean and fresh. Flower beds and pretty little gardens. The narrow road seems to loop round a long, deep depression in the ground. I cross the road and see the depression is a lake. Big white plastic pedlos shaped like swans are tied up in the middle and shitloads of real swans swim about. The pond is oval-shaped with a building at one end. I walk towards the building, humming to myself and watching the swans. The building has a swimming pool inside. Looking through the window, I see a corpse floating in the water face down. Stupid cunt must have drowned. Who goes swimming when the zombie apocalypse is upon them? Stupid fucking Isle of Shite people. Inbred with webbed feet, probably. Making all the poor normal zombies do all the work while he shags his sister. Dirty fucking inbred cunt. There's no sign of life here. 
Ha! <laughs> no sign of life. What do I expect? A street party? Fuck you. I keep walking along the promenade, heading towards the shitty town. The road is bordered on one side by big houses set back behind long gardens. Probably where they sat and wanked themselves off at how lucky they were to live here. Before long, I'm near the town, passing a bowling alley and ice rink. I duck down quickly, seeing a group of figures in the distance. There's dried and congealed blood all over the place here. Rotting corpses litter the street. Signs of zombie mayhem everywhere and my little zombie heart flutters at the promising sight. I move forward, cautiously flitting between walls and smashed up vehicles, until I get close enough to see the figures of my lovely brothers and sisters, all gathered in front of the front doors to a big hotel. I stay still for a few minutes and check there are no heroes nearby wielding axes or trying to be like Super Golden Bollocks Owie. Nothing obvious, so I saunter across the road. The thick fucking idiots don't notice me coming. No wonder they're so easy to kill if they don't take the time or effort to even glance around once in a while. They smell wonderful, rotten, rancid and fetid. I breathe deeply, inhaling the magical aroma and admiring their advanced state of decomposition. They really haven't been taking care of themselves very well. They look hungry, the poor blighters. I stand for a few minutes with my arms crossed. They still don't notice me. So I cough politely and watch as they start to shuffle round until they're all facing me. Take me to your leader, I command, half joking, but they just stare back at me. Stupid cunts. I try to focus and get into their minds like I did before with my lot. I can't connect, though. Some of them are standing at the top of some steps, constantly walking forward into a closed door. I walk up the stairs, pushing them gently away until I reach the door. I push the handle down and pull it open. Stupid fucking fuckwits would have stood there for eternity, waiting for the magical wall to move out of the way. They groan louder and start shuffling into the lobby of the hotel. Once inside, I realise why they were standing outside. The smell of humans is strong here. There are survivors inside. The group stagger forward, heads lolling about and feet shuffling along the floor. For a laugh, I act like they do, rolling my head about and pushing drool out of my mouth, but it gets boring and I give up within a couple of minutes. The smell of the humans drives them on. I can't help but get caught up in the moment of the chase. The scent of urgency increases as the scent grows stronger. Body odour both stale and fresh, shit and piss. I can even smell vomit. It's like rose water to my nose. The biggest scent is fear. I can smell their fear. It's mixed in the sweat and leaves a pheromone trail which the zombies pick up on like ants. The hotel has an old style decor with dark wood doors and walls. Old floral wallpaper and gilt picture frames adorn the walls. The horde follow corridors, stopping each time they reach a fire door that opens inwards, too stupid to figure out how to pull the handle. The thing inside me was smart and enabled me to drive my brethren on. I could manipulate and make them love me, make them adore me. I'm frustrated that these moronic, shambling creatures are not responding to me. I keep up with them, opening doors and gaining them access to the succulent brains they so desire. This fucking hotel is like a rabbit warren. Fucking corridors everywhere. We're like foxes hunting the rabbits down. Terrier dogs sent in to flush them out. I ate a little white bunny rabbit a few hours ago. Poor little white bunny hopping about with his long velvety ears and then nasty zombie smithy comes along and takes a big bitey whitey out of him. The horde stop ahead of me, prevented from moving forward by yet another door. This one has a sign warning of a steep staircase beyond. Ah, they're hiding in the cellar. The good old-fashioned cellar, eh? Those cheeky little survivors thinking they can tuck themselves away in the dark recesses. Judging by the smell, they must have been down there the whole week, shitting in pots and drinking their own piss. Well, they didn't reckon on meeting Smithy the super zombie, did they? Cunts. Speaking of which, I turn to the nearest undead. Have you got a super zombie in charge round here? I ask him. He drools back at me with those gorgeous red eyes staring blankly. Poor sod, he looks hungry. 
Come on, chum. Let's see if we can't get you some lunch, eh? I try the handle, but the door is locked securely from within. It's a solid door, and it will take some effort to batter it down. I clear my throat and knock on the door. Three heavy knocks. And I smile at the thought of the people inside all shitting themselves and staring up the staircase. I knock again and start giggling. The zombies round me are groaning and I put my finger to my lips and try and shush them quiet. Be quiet or they'll hear us. I giggle again and knock again, harder this time. Hello, I shout out. Is anyone there? No response and I knock again. Uh, hello, listen, I know you're down there. I have some very hungry zombies up here, so will you please open up and let us eat your brains, please? Still no response. Listen, we're not going away and we will get in. I bang my foot against the door repeatedly. The sound echoes round the corridor and shakes the frame. Come on, we just want one of you. I can tell you've got a whole group down there. Just send one out and we'll leave you alone. I press my ear to the door, listening to the low murmur of voices. I start banging my foot again, steady and rhythmic, knowing it must be scaring the shit out of them. My nose twitches, and I scent that we're literally scaring the shit out of at least one of them. Just one, come on, just send one out. We'll eat him or her really quickly, and I promise they won't suffer. The murmurings intensify. Several voices now. Then the tread of soft footsteps coming up the staircase behind the door. I listen intently as the footsteps get closer until they stop. The person must be standing on the other side of the door now. I pull my foot back, slam it into the door and hear someone jump back. Ha! I made you jump, didn't I? What do you want? A male voice calls out, a deep voice trying to sound confident and strong. Brains, we want brains. I laugh at myself. No, but seriously, we do need something to eat, please. Can you send one out? Just an old one. A shitty hotel like this must have been packed with old duffers. Just send the oldest one out, that'll do us. Fuck off, mate. There's a few of us down here and we're armed too. Try and get in and see what happens. Hey, no need for that aggression, is there? You sick fucking... Fucking... Fucking what? Sick fucking what? We all just sick. Good comeback. Fuck off. No, you fuck off. Get fucked. No, you get fucked. We're not opening the door, and if you try and get in, we'll cut you to pieces. No, you get cut to pieces. What? That one didn't work very well, did it? Not really. Can we try again? Try what? Exchanging insults. Listen, mate, just fuck off. Ah, uh, thanks. Uh, no, you fuck off. This is stupid. Go away. No, you're stupid. Do you want them things to find you, you fucking idiot? What things? Uh, you're the fucking idiot. Stop doing that. Doing what? Repeating things back to me. No, you stop repeating things. If you keep making so much noise, they'll find you. Now piss off and make some noise somewhere else. They already found me. Who did? Those things, the zombies. They already found me. I am one. What? I am one of those things. Don't be so bloody stupid now. Piss off before they get you. No, really, I am one. Actually, to be honest, I'm a super zombie. You bloody dick. Piss off. No, really, I am. These others just stand about drooling, but I can speak and think. Oh, yeah, and how did that happen, then? Well, to cut a long story short, I was a recruit for the Territorial Army at Salisbury when this happened. We got through the weekend, but then this bloke called Howie and his mate Dave came and sort of rescued us to try and get this big vehicle called a Saxon. We helped them and had a big fight and then went to London to try and rescue his sister. But on the way, we got stuck at some services and loads of zombie rats tried getting us. I reckon I got infected then, but I'm not too sure on that point. Anyways, we carried on and met this bloke called Chris and his mates Clarence and Malcolm. We went to a hospital to get some things for their commune and then tried to get the sister. Big battle, lots of blood. I got dragged in and turned and McKinney got chomped a bit too. So that's when I became a super zombie and I made all the other zombies be in my army. 
saw Howie on Tower Bridge. We shouted at each other a bit, you know, difference of artistic direction, that kind of thing. He said some things, I said some things. I said my army was going to get him. He said his army was going to get all the other zombies. Ended up with us, my zombie army, that is, chasing him down to this fort on the coast. But things didn't quite work out, really. Dave, how his mate that is, well, he set these traps and loads of my zombies got killed. Then there was a big battle, and well, if I'm honest about it, I didn't really plan that well, and we kind of lost. But I did manage to get a few of his mates killed. I think it was Curtis, Tucker and Malcolm, maybe more. Definitely Jamie, though. I got him myself. So, long story short, I had to leg it, figuring that Howie was coming after me, but then I found this rabbit, and it made me think of the Isle of Wight, and I realised he'd sent them all here. Who sent what here? Oh, sorry, I meant Howie. He sent the women and children here. That's why I'm here. To get them before he does. What? What for? To eat them, of course. Have you not been listening? You need help. Are you volunteering? Not that kind of help. You need mental help. So that's where we are now. I'm looking about to try and find them, and I saw my brothers and sisters looking hungry, so I thought I'd try and help them out. You're nuts. Fucking nuts. Piss off. No, you piss off. No, hang on, I'm not doing that again. Listen, we will get in and chomp everyone if we have to. Or you can chuck an old one out. It's some lunatic saying he's a super zombie, the man shouts down the stairs. I've told him to piss off. This hotel is old. And the cellar would have been used for storing all manner of things in the old days before fridges and freezers. There must be another entrance at street level, so they could take deliveries without having to go through the hotel and scare the old fuckers. I move away and start heading back down the corridor. To my pleasant surprise, the horde follow me. I wasn't expecting that. Leading them back through the corridors, we reach the front door and go outside, the horde following close behind me. I have to move slowly because of their daytime shuffle. Outside... I spy a set of railings fixed round some concrete steps leading to a wooden door with a small hatch cut into it at head height. I pull the gate open and head down. My horde follow me until we're all crammed into the bottom and backed up on the stairs. I try again to connect them so I can send some round to the other door we were just at, but I just can't seem to do it now. I bang on the door again, call out and wait for a few seconds. The same voice from the other door calls out, telling me to fuck off. Open the hatch and you'll see I'm a super zombie. You're a fucking nut, is what you... The man's mouth falls open and his voice trails off as he peers out of the now open hatch. Metal bars prevent me from lunging at him. Hiya! I lift my hand and wiggle my fingers, smiling in all my dirty undead glory. Fuck me. No thanks, I'm not that kind of zombie. Now about that lunch we were discussing. Jesus, you're one of them. Don't call me that, and yes, I am one of them. Sort of, kind of. But you can speak. Well, fuck a duck. Look who's being Mr Cleverclogs. He stares back, open-mouthed, and turns to say something to the people inside. More faces squeeze into view, peering out at me. I smile and nod politely at them in turn. Hi, hello there, nice to meet you, how are you today? All the time, grinning and wiggling my fingers at them. The first man comes back into view. Can you see my horde? I motion to the side and watch him leaning over to look up the stairs, taking in all the mortified, drooling undead. He looks back and nods. Good, now we're on the same frequency, John. My name isn't John. You look like a John. Anyway, John, now we're on the same level. How about our deal, eh? What deal? He sounds shocked to the core, and the scent of fear has increased rapidly, causing my little horde to get all agitated. Now, now, John, we had a deal. You're going to send someone out for us to eat. My little lambs here need some nourishment. I can't. We can't. Please. Oh, you will, John. You will send someone out because you know what the alternative is, don't you, John? Yes, you do. One or all. I will get inside one way or the other. 
I could burn this door down, or maybe even set fire to the hotel. There's no fire service anymore, John. No police. You can swing your knives and weapons about all day long, but once we're inside, you're all dead. Now I will give you a minute to send someone out, or we're coming in. Please, mate, I can't. Time is ticking, John, and it's not far from getting dark. You know what happens when it gets dark, don't you, John? He nods back, leaning over again to look at the undead around me. Please, don't do this. Please just leave us alone. His voice is pleading. Tears stream down his face. More sobs and crying come from inside. Up to you, John. I turn and start going through the pockets of my zombies, pulling out bits of paper and receipts. Eventually I find what I'm looking for. Ah, here we are. I take the lighter and set fire to a piece of paper. It's only small, but I drop it down to the bottom of the door and start adding more bits of paper and dried leaves that have gathered in the disused stairwell. Smoke starts billowing out and from the screams inside, I know it's going into the cellar. OK, OK! John, who is not John, shouts in alarm. What's that, John? OK, put it out, put it out! Screams and sobs emanate from inside, joined by raised voices, loud and aggressive. We'll send someone out! His voice breaks with emotion. I stamp down on the small flames, quickly extinguishing them. That can be started again very quickly, John. We'll do it, I swear. But if we open this door, you'll try and get in. He's sobbing hard now. Not so much the tough guy anymore, is he? Stupid fat cunt. If we send one out, you promise to leave us alone? He begs. No, I don't fucking promise anything, you fat turd. Now send one out, or I'll torch this fucking building down and eat you while you're cooking. The hatch slams shut, and I lean forward, smiling at the shouting and bedlam going on inside. Lunch is almost ready. Have you washed your hands? No? Oh well. I smile at my lovelies, all watching me expectantly. Please... Please just move back. We'll send him out now. Roger Dodger, I call back, pushing my beautiful babies back up the stairs. Come on, come on, move back a little. We get to the top and gather round the railings, staring down into the basement. The hatch opens quickly and John, who is not John, quickly looks out. I wave down at him and the hatch slams shut at the same time as the door opens. An old man walks quickly out and stands there as the door is slammed shut again. Hello? I smile down at him. He looks up, tall, straight-backed and dignified. He looks ancient and weathered, but not scared. He looks back at me without fear, staring into my eyes. Young man? He nods once, his voice old but strong. So were you forced out or did you volunteer? He stares back and takes a long, withering look at me before he answers. I volunteered. I am old and death does not frighten me. Now let's get this over with, shall we? He starts climbing the stairs, slowly, using the handrail. He reaches the top and pauses by the gate, blocked by the zombies standing there salivating messily down their chins. Move back, let the man out. Surprisingly, the zombies do as bid and move away from the gate, shuffling backwards but keeping their gaze fixed on him. The old man steps out from the gate and turns to stare down at me. Bushy eyebrows and wrinkled skin, but the eyes are bright and intelligent. I noticed his fists clenching. There's fight in the old dog, I smile at him. I won't fight you. You'll hurt the others if I don't do as you ordered. If I want them, I'll take them. You fighting back won't make any difference at all. His eyes stay fixed on mine, a glimmer in them. This old boy wants to go out fighting. I nod at the zombies surrounding him. I can't connect to them, but they seem to understand what I'm telling them. Their groans rise audibly and they shuffle forward, pulling lips back and bearing dirty, yellowing teeth. 
You filthy fiends, the man shouts and punches out surprisingly hard for such an old fucker. He connects and sends one flying back. I laugh at the sight and watch as he tries to skip round, punching out with straight jabs, knocking my lovelies about like a bunch of walking punch bags. Go on, get him, I shout, and they lunge in harder. He keeps punching out, knocking them back. Ha! I boxed in the army, the old man shouts in triumph. I dart in and kick him hard in the back of the knee. He drops down with a loud yelp, and I punch him hard to the back of the head, sending him sprawling onto the ground. Take him, but not too much. This old fucker might be useful. I watch in rapture as my lovelies descend. My heart beats faster, and I feel a growing sense of excitement as their teeth rip flesh from the backs of his legs and arms. One goes for the neck, and I push him away with my foot. He cowers down, crawls back into the feeding pile. I wait for a few seconds until they've each had a bite, then order them away. They respond and break apart, shuffling back. I crouch down and hold my face close to an open wound on the back of one of his meaty thighs. The smell of fresh blood makes my mouth pour with saliva. I reach my tongue out, gently touching the wound and savouring the taste. The urge to bite down is almost overpowering, but I hold off, torturing myself with the knowledge that I can take that bite if I want to. Seconds pass as I gently lick at the wound, my tongue tingling from the metallic taste of it. It's too much. I can't resist. I bite down and murmur with orgasmic satisfaction as I chew on the still warm, soft meat. Standing back, we gather in a circle, watching the body. The wound was bleeding openly, but within seconds of the infection taking hold, the bleeding slows. Then the limbs start to twitch and the body jerks a couple of times. He rolls over onto his back, his legs kicking out in spasm. He sits up and opens his eyes, the red bloodshot eyes of the undead. Welcome aboard. Now get up. We've got work to do. 7. Is it a boat? Yes, Mr Howie. How the fuck can you see that from this distance, Dave? He shrugs, never taking his eyes from the object berthed on the sand way off in the distance. Fair enough, I guess. What else would it be stuck out on the sand like that? But for Dave to actually see it clearly is staggering. The man never ceases to amaze me. The tide has gone out, leaving a vast stretch of sand between the sea and the shoreline. Even the last hundred metres of sea is too shallow for us to go into without risk of beaching our rib. We've already circled the end of the pier, a massive structure built on pylons embedded into the earth. The pier must be at least half a mile long and is shaped like a hammer with large buildings built onto the T-section at the end. There was nothing obvious on the pier, no collection of boats tied up and no signs of life either. We moved off, keeping the shore on our right until we saw the dark object on the sand in the distance. It must be his, Nick mutters quietly now the engine is just ticking over. What makes you say that? Clarence asks. The tide has only just gone out, which means the boat was taken in towards the land and beached. Otherwise, the boat would be a lot closer to the shore. That boat got stuck there as the tide went out. Makes sense, I say. The seabed here is smooth sand. Once the tide comes back in, that boat will refloat and get pulled all over the place, probably into the pier. So that must be either his boat or someone else that decided to come for a day trip. What are the chances of that? Not very likely, Mr. Howie, Nick replies. OK, mate, let's shoot along and see if we can see the other boats anywhere. They might give an indication where they went. Nick pushes the lever over and once again the engines roar into life, lifting the front of the boat up. I catch a glimpse of Dave gripping the rails but staring hard at the boat on the sand. I'll have to move out in case of sandbanks, Nick shouts, turning the wheel and angling us away from the shoreline a little further. Dave keeps his eyes fixed on the beach. Blowers and Cookie do the same, having ditched the jokes for a while. I should have brought some binoculars. 
More haste, less speed, or something like that. No, more speed, less haste. Don't they mean the same thing? I shake my head to clear the confusing thoughts and focus on the beach. A town is built onto a steep hill at the end of the pier. Big, old Victorian buildings painted white. Church spires and tower tops fixed to the tops of roofs. It does look beautiful and old. Something from long ago. A distant time when things were built for beauty and not just for their practical worth or cost-effectiveness. The town gives way to a large green open area running alongside the Golden Beach that in turn ends abruptly at a high wall that towers over the sea. We keep moving on, looking hard for any signs of boats. Another town alongside the shore now. No pier this time, though. It looks to be just a small village, and I figure the island will have loads of these all round the coast, which could make our hunt very hard. We follow the coast as it sweeps round a long curve. More beaches bordered by green areas come into view, but still no sign of boats. Howie! Clarence is shouting and pointing in the distance to another round fort built into the sea. This one looks smaller than the other two and is built a lot closer to the land. I nod at Nick, motioning for him to head that way. He powers on some more, glancing down at the fuel gauge. The boat flies across the water and within minutes we're again circling a fort. This one looks like the first, old and derelict with big signs warning people to stay off and the same style of locked gate. I shake my head and turn to face the others. Isn't there a harbour anywhere near here? Lois calls out. If the tide is out now, it might have been in when they got here. They could have gone right into the harbour, if there is one. I shrug my shoulders. Try back towards the pier. We'll check the other side. We're so far out from the shore we can't see a bloody thing. Nick nods and spins the boat round again powering on, and we slip into silence, drowned out once again by the loud engines. A few hundred metres from the pier, Dave is shielding his eyes from the sun with one hand and waving the other in my direction. I tap Nick on the arm and he instantly pulls the lever back, gliding the boat to a slow pace. Over there looks like masts, Dave shouts out. I look ahead but can see nothing of any detail from this distance. I can't see anything, I call down. There's something there, a wall coming out onto the beach, Cookie shouts. Might be a harbour wall, Dave adds, keeping his eyes fixed in that direction. Looking round, I see that the beached boat isn't that far away. Darren could have been aiming for the harbour when he got cut off by the receding tide. We'll go for it here then. Nick, get us in as close as you can and we'll wade in. Got it. Nick points the boat towards the shore and powers on enough to push us forward until we're in the shallows. The sandy seabed is clearly visible through the clear water. The boat grinds against the bottom and Nick cuts the engine before moving back to pull it out of the water. Have a look for an anchor, he shouts. We all start mooching about, realising the seats lift up to reveal cupboard space within them. Is this it? Blowers lifts a heavy metal-looking thing shaped like a cross, a long rope attached to the end. No, that's the flare gun, Nick replies in a sarcastic tone. All right, Captain Blackbeard, keep your air on. Do I chuck it over then? Blowers asks. Yes, mate, it might help, Nick says, fiddling about with the engine. Blowers chucks the anchor over, and Cookie bursts out laughing, causing Nick to spin round and see Blowers going red in the face. Fucking idiot didn't tie it on, Cookie says, still laughing. Piss off, Cookie, I'm not into seamen like you. Who chucks an anchor over without tying it on first? And you joined the Royal Marines too. Cookie, get fucked, and I was only in the Marines for a few weeks. Why, did you lose their anchor too? Dave shakes his head, his bag already on his back. He jumps over into the knee-high water and lifts the anchor back into the boat, which prompts Cookie to stop laughing, but Blowers to start. Lost the anchor, did I? Yeah, well, you still chucked it over without tying it on, Cookie retorts. Dave ties the rope on and drops the anchor down into the sea again. By that time, we're all ready and sliding over the rubber-inflated skirt into the warm sea. I scoop water into my hands and wash my face. Within seconds, the hot sun has dried the water and I feel the tightness on my skin from the drying salt. 
It takes several minutes to wade through the shallow water and start crossing the sand, and I'm sweating freely already. After the constant noise of the engines, the silence is profound. Looking about, I think of the gorgeous weather and how packed this beach would have been before the event happened. It goes on there. The beach is still here and the sea comes in and goes out. The seagulls fly down to snatch at the crabs scuttling about. Life goes on. Maybe we're just one species that has come to a natural end. Maybe that's what happened to the dinosaurs. The giant meteor that wiped them out was carrying a zombie virus that turned them all into undead dinosaurs. That would have been a good film, Jurassic Zombie Park. We walk close to the boat left on the sand, and I can see what Nick meant now. The boat is resting as though dropped by the tide. It wouldn't be like that if it had been floating about for a few days. Someone has been here very recently, and Darren is the logical choice. Which means that Dave was right. He's going after the women and children. The thought makes me focus harder, and without words being spoken, we all increase our pace. Dave was right. The wall is part of the harbour. Long white masts stand to attention, some with flags hanging limp in the still air. As we get closer, we can see that with the tide out, the bottom of the harbour has a thick layer of mud, so we skirt round the outside of the harbour wall and walk up through the soft sand and onto the promenade. Finally, standing on firm ground with the sun drying out our wet trousers, each of us, apart from Dave, is already hot and sweaty. We walk along the promenade silently, looking all around in case of any undead lurking about, waiting to lunge and bite none of us trusting that they will be the same slow, shuffling daytime zombies that we might expect. Reaching the harbour entrance, we walk along the high outer path and stare down at the myriad of boats and yachts moored up to the pontoons. There are many boats here, of all shapes and sizes, and none of us have any idea what vessels they use to transport the members of our group. Any ideas which ones they used? I say quietly. Hang on, Mr Howie. Dave replies quietly. He jogs down one of the steep ramps to the pontoons and runs the length of the closest one, back onto the main walkway and up the next one. Halfway up the third, he drops down to examine something, picks it up and looks about before heading back towards us. He hands over a shiny, metallic object. It's a police badge, Clarence remarks, like they have on their hats. Ted! The canny old bugger, he would have left it there on purpose, I exclaim with a smile. So they came in here then? Blowers asks, looking about as he speaks. Which way now, though? Dave, if you were leading them, where would you take them? He doesn't hesitate before answering. I would have shot that man on the fort and taken that. OK, uh, Clarence, well, what would you do? Stay away from the town. It's a big group and very vulnerable. I would head away from denser areas and try to get rural, somewhere defensible where I can hole up for a couple of days at least. Ted was in the services, and he's a switched-on bloke, plus they've got the Navy captain with them. I reckon he would do the same thing. So that'll be the way then. I motion down the beach, away from the town and the pier. Clarence nods back firmly. Movement, Nick mutters. We turn round to see him facing back on the promenade towards a children's fairground built onto a big grassy area. Where? Dave asks. In the fairground, a couple of figures moving about. Zombies? Can't tell from here. Just saw them flitting between the gaps in the fence, Nick replies. More from the other direction, Cookie says quietly. I look down the promenade and see a horde moving towards us, unmistakable in their slow, jerky movements. Ten. Dave answers before anyone asks. Opposite, Clarence says, more coming from across the grass. A reasonable sized horde clustered together but spreading out. I think Smithy has prepared a welcome for us, Blowers comments under his breath. We've got the sea behind us, well a big muddy harbour anyway and zombies on three sides boxing us in. Run or fight, what do you fancy? It's too hot to run anywhere. Clarence rumbles, and besides, they'll only follow us anyway. True. Fight it is, then. Let's move out from here. I don't fancy scrapping next to these high walls, I say, looking down at the squidgy mud beneath us. Walking out of the harbour and onto the grassy area, I see more zombies coming from the direction of the fairground, at least another ten. Twelve, 
Dave says, correcting me as if he knew what I was thinking, which he probably did. Fuck me, that makes it about 30 of them and six of us, I say. 33, Dave says. So how many is that each? I start doing the math in my head. Five and a half each, Dave replies instantly. Half each? How are we going to do that then? We could take our five each and share the leftovers, Cookie says. What's that? Three left over if we take five each? Yes, Dave says. How are we going to share three between six of us? I ask. Take them as pairs? Nick offers. Okay, yeah, I like that. Actually, we got three lots coming at us and three pairs. How about a friendly wager between gentlemen, I say. I'm up for that. Clarence smiles back. The others are smiling and nodding. Right, teams. I guess it will be Blurs and Cookie, Nick and Clarence, then me and Dave. Not fair, Blurs replies quickly. You've got Dave and Nick's got Clarence and I'm stuck with a bumlord here. Fuck you, Blurs. Mr Howie, can I swap, please? Cookie says. For fuck's sake, Clarence, are you okay with Cookie? And Nick, you go with Blurs. Still not fair, though, Nick remarks. You've got Dave, so you're bound to win. Uh, no offence, Clarence. None taken, he rumbles. Fuck me backwards. OK, Dave, you're only allowed to use one knife. OK, Mr Howie. No, no knives at all makes it fair, Cookie says. Clarence is smiling and shaking his head. Dave, no knives at all. Really? Dave asks. But that means Clarence can't use weapons either, Nick says. No, hang on, that means you and Blowers get to use weapons while me and Mr Howie are handicapped with partners just using their hands, Cookie says, getting a glare from Clarence and Dave at the same time. Uh, but that's fine though, he adds quickly. Right, we agreed then. Dave and Clarence no weapons unless they deem it appropriate, in which case the bet is off. First pair back here with all their zombies dead is the winner. What about the loser? Clarence asks. Uh, the loser has to make the first brew for everyone when we find somewhere suitable. Happy? They nod back in agreement. Clarence, if Cookie tries touching you, just tell him to stop. He gets a bit touchy-feely gropey when he's excited, Blowers says in mock earnest. You're such a twat, Blowers, Cookie says with a long sigh. We break apart. Blowers and Cookie exchanging more insults and abuse as we turn to face our sides. Dave and I walking slowly towards the horde coming across the grass. Dave looks almost sulky. What's up with you? I ask him. I like knives, he replies in a downbeat voice. I know, mate, it's only for this time. You can use them again next time. OK, Mr Howie. I'll go left, you go right, meet in the middle. He nods back at me. Ready, Dave? Yes, Mr Howie. The horde is stretched out in a line, and I move over to the far left, watching them track me with their eyes. Gripping the axe tight, I take no chances in trusting they'll keep to the slow daytime shuffle and move round the back of them, watching as they start to stagger round to face me. I take the opportunity and move in quickly, striking the first one through the neck and taking his head clean off. I step backwards and check around me, then dart in and sweep the axe down, cleaving into the skull of an undead female splitting her cranium apart and spilling brains out onto her shoulders before she sags down. A quick glance, and I can see Dave has already taken three down and is on his fourth, violently wrenching the head sideways to break the neck. I swing the double-headed axe into the stomach of the next one, cutting deep into their midriff and watching bright red innards falling out. Punching down into the face, as I draw the axe back, I turn for the next one to find them all down, and Dave standing there watching me. I only got three. Sorry, did you want more, Mr Howie? Bit late now, unless they come back again as undead undeads. Turning to check on the others, I see Clarence lifting his last one up bodily before dropping it down hard on his knee, breaking the spine. He rolls the body off his leg and looks over, both of us realising we've each finished and sprinting back to the start at the same time. We both dive forward and land in a heap, laughing and giggling like idiots, trying to push each other away. Ah, oh, fuck you now, Blowers moans as he and Nick both look at their last standing zombie, an old man with big bushy eyebrows. We've lost, he adds sorely.
The old man undead shuffles closer to Blowers, then suddenly darts forward with speed. We shout a warning, and Blowers ducks out the way. The old man zombie turns with surprising dexterity and faces Blowers again, before raising his fists in a boxing pose and going at Blowers with a fast pace, throwing straight jabs at Blowers' head. Blowers ducks and weaves backwards, instinctively raising his own fists to protect his face. He lashes out and the old man blocks the punch, throwing another one which just misses Blowers as he ducks down. What's he doing? Cookie shouts in alarm, watching Blowers trading punches with an ancient zombie boxer. He's quick, I'll give him that, Clarence says, watching the spectacle. Who, Blowers or the zombie? I ask. The zombie? He's very quick and he looks fresh too. No decay and the wound on the back of his leg is still open. He's just been turned then, I say. Dave has drawn his handgun and tracks the zombie darting about and throwing punches at Blowers. Blowers suddenly speeds up and launches a flurry of body blows on the zombie, sending him reeling backwards. He keeps up the barrage, carefully avoiding hitting the zombie in the face, but landing blows everywhere else, including the side of his head with powerful hooks. Blowers, move back! Dave shouts, still trying to track the zombie with his pistol. I've got him! Blowers shouts back. Move back now! Dave roars. Blowers instantly does as he's told. Dave holsters his weapon and runs towards the zombie, drawing a knife and sweeping it across the old man's throat. He savagely jerks the head back as he does it, forcing the zombie to fall face down on the ground. Don't ever do that again! Dave roars at a stunned Blowers. You could cut your hands and get his blood in you. Show me your hands. But I thought of that and didn't hit his face, Blowers replies meekly. Show me your hands, Dave says, his voice still hard-edged. Blowers holds his hands out, palms down, as Dave inspects them closely. I'm really sorry, Dave, Blowers says. He looks crestfallen. Any of us would, being told off by Dave like that. I did avoid hitting his face in case I cut myself. He's already bleeding and we still don't know how Darren got infected, Dave replies quickly. I'm sorry, Dave, Blowers repeats, looking ashamed and embarrassed. It's done now. Dave drops his hands and starts to turn away. Good moves, though. Good skills. Well done. We'll practice more of that later, Dave adds in a softer tone. I'm both stunned and amazed at Dave showing awareness of someone else's feelings like that. And you're making the bruise later. This time, my mouth drops open. 8. I've made a connection. That old fucker from the hotel cellar. It must have been the blood I took from him. If I'd known that, I would have brought that old crow a bit in the shop with me. I can't see through his eyes, but there's definitely a connection there. As soon as he got up off the ground, I knew he was mine. It's got to be the blood we shared. I wonder if it works with other bodily fluids or just blood. Those fucking wanking fucktards standing over there on the grass chatting all cool and heroic while my lovelies surround them. I only sent a few in. Save the rest for later. I've been a busy boy running around this shitty little town collecting up my groupies. Although I can't connect to them, they still follow me. And that old boy, well, he's a peach. There's something there. A feeling of control. A bit like before when I had my army, only not so strong. I can will him to move and do things, but I can't see or hear anything from him. Oh well. Make the best of a bad lot, I say. Those utter cunts, I fucking hate them. I fucking detest them. I'm going to rip their fucking heads off and unload my zombie runny turds down their throats. No. Better than that, I'll tie them down and get my lovelies to hold their mouths open while I shit down their still living throats. Yeah, fuck yeah. Infection by poo. Fuck you, Howie. Eat my shit. I stand across the road in some gardens, peering through the bushes like some dirty voyeur. The stupid cunts were racing up and down the sea in a high-powered boat, letting every zombie in the town know they're coming. Fucking cock chops, what did they expect? Use a fucking great boat like that and then storming up the beach like a bunch of invading twats. 
I blame Dave, the nasty little runt cunt. Dave, the cunt runt. Cunt runt Dave. Now look at them, going off in pairs and taking my babies out. You wait, though. You fucking wait for my old boy. Couldn't work out better than blowers and that thick fucker Nick going over to him. Oh, look at Dave snapping necks like a regular Rambo and Clarence chucking them about like dolls. I can see how he, my zombie cock, twitches with the thought of watching him die right now. Ah, there's my old boy giving it the slow shuffle and waiting for blowers to get in nice and close. Fuck me, he was quick. He's throwing punches like a right old brawler. Look at him go. Straight for blowers. One, two, yeah, go on, smash his fucking teeth in. Blowers is quick, though, and ducks about, smacking my lovely old man about. This is fucking classic, watching blowers getting ragged about by an old man. Until Dave shouts and stabs him in the neck. Fucking spoil sport. He ruins everything. He has to fucking take over, doesn't he? Now look at him, standing there, caressing blowers' hands, probably giving him a sly hand job at the same time. You utter fucking cunts! Fuck me, did I just do that? Oops, a bit too soon. Oh shit, they heard me. Here they come, running like a bunch of girls. I jump out, stick my fingers up, and then leg it with Billy Big Legs. I will kill you! That's Dave roaring away with his big voice. Gotta catch me first, you stumpy little midget. I run quickly with the advantage of already scouting the way, going down the side of the house and running down the street towards the town. Come on, you cunts, chase me. Keep coming, you fuckers. I reach the end of the road and stand on the junction for a second until they come into view. Dave out front, sprinting hard. I wave and start running again, leading them down narrow streets and back towards the town. I reach another junction with a steep hill going off to my left and the seafront down to my right. I pause for a second to make sure they can see me and start off up the hill. There's an old derelict hotel up here that I spied earlier. Perfect for what I've got in mind. The hill is steep, but the infection keeps me going, powering me on, whereas before I would have collapsed on the ground by now, sucking on a cigarette. Dirty things. Funny that. I haven't wanted one since I turned. I give up smoking and be a zombie. Fuck, Dave is quick. I pause just long enough to make sure they're all coming, and I run into the overgrown grounds. What was once a large car park is now covered in huge weeds and bushes. I run round the back and open the door I prepared earlier and then run off in the other direction and over the high wall into an adjoining garden. I slump down beneath the wall and get my breathing under control, listening for the footsteps of Dave and his merry men. Round here! Dave bellows out and it's not long before I hear the rest of them chugging into the grounds to join their stumpy little mate. Where did he go? I hear Howie panting. I lost him here, Dave answers. That door's open, he must have gone in there, Howie says. Maybe, or he could have gone over that wall and round the other side, Dave says. It'll be dark soon, we need to get off the street. That's Clarence's deep voice. Fuck it, he must have gone in there, Howie says. We're going in, Blower's voice. Yeah, come on, Howie says. My smile grows wide as I listen to them pushing the door open and entering the hotel. Perfect. Fucking perfect. That hotel is huge and it will take them a while to work their way round. Plus, there are the little surprises I left for them. Poor little babies locked in hotel rooms on their own. Fuck it, might get a lucky bite out of one of them. I wait another ten minutes until the shadows grow longer and the sky darkens. They'll be well within the building now, slowly peeking out over the top of the wall. I make sure they've gone inside and not left a trap for me. No sign of them. Good. I climb over and drop down on the other side. I sneak over to the door and pull it closed. There's an old padlock clasp on the door, attached to a loop on the wall. Get the bit of metal I found earlier and jam it into the loop, securing the door closed. Stupid fuckwits. How did they win the battle with stupidity like this? Running over the road and into a front garden, I work my way to the high wooden gate, giving access to the rear garden. Pushing it open, 
I smile at the lovely horde all waiting for me. I leave the gate open and move down a few houses, repeating the action. Only forty or so zombies. Not enough. And I look into the sky, willing the sun to drop down and let the night begin. I know what will happen, and I feel a sense of excitement course through my wonderfully infected system. The zombies shuffle out of their garden gates and slowly trudge across the road towards the hotel. The last glimmer of sun high on the side of the hotel slowly slides up the wall. Looking down the hill, I can see the sea shimmering with golden rays as the sun drops down. Any second now, come on you fucking cunts. My foot's tapping with impatience at the still shuffling zombies. Stupid fucking idiots. Why don't they speed up? Don't they know how he and his gang of zombie bashers are in that hotel? Fuck yes, here it is. The sun drops and my lovelies all stand still, lifting their beautiful rotten faces to the sky. The urge overtakes me and I do the same. As one, we roar out, letting all the other zombies know where we are. Howling guttural wails fill the air as every undead across the land lifts their head and screams into the night. Fuck you, Howie. We're not slow and shuffling now, are we? The howling ceases, and my beauties come alive. Moving faster and with purpose, they pour across the road, heading for the hotel. I glance up and see pale faces peering out from the grimy windows. They've heard the howling and come to look. One of them must have seen me. He fires through the window, and I just about duck down as the round whips by my head. Fucking lovely. That shot will bring all my brothers and sisters here. Couldn't have been Dave firing. The lack of a new hole in my head tells me that. Groans and scuffles come from all around me as zombies stagger towards the hotel. Moving fast now. Their movements more controlled and the evil presence of them intensifies. Love it. Fucking love it. Now it's nice and dark. I keep to the shadows, skirting the edge of the building. Moving low between windows and glass pane doors. The hotel has balconies on most levels, rising at least five storeys up, and I keep a close eye on them in case they fire down at me. A large number of my zombies follow me, keeping up easily now it's dark. I lead them to the rear and pull the clasp open, shoving the door open and letting the zombies stagger inside. After about twenty have passed through, I pull the door closed and refasten the clasp. Leading more zombies round the side and looking for other entrances, I want to leave groups at the doors and exit points to prevent the fuckers getting out. But there's no control over these zombies and they just follow me about. A full loop round the hotel and I'm back to the door at the rear, leading a huge horde with me. There's loads now, pouring in from all directions, drawn by the noise of the gunshot and activity and the smell of each other. The only way to stop them following me is for me to lose them somehow, but I need to keep them here to trap Howie and his cunts. Opening the door again, I slip inside and let a few more follow me through, seeing as there's shitloads of them outside. Once a few more have got in, I push the door closed and force some poor zombie to stagger backwards. Wedging a chair under the handle, I move off deeper into the hotel. The only light is from the bright moon shining through the windows. I work my way quietly towards the front as my new horde get the smell of humans in their noses and start off into the deep recesses, following the scent trail. An old fire exit marks my way out and I push the big metal handle down, easing the door open and squeezing out. The door locks when I push it closed and I quickly dart across the road, ducking down in the shadows to turn back and watch for a bit. My lovelies are all round the hotel now, groaning away with hunger as they sent survivors inside. Howie and his bum chum mates will have a nice surprise. Couldn't have worked out better. Leaving them busy for the night, I move off to continue my search for Howie's little piggies. 9. We enter the hotel and work our way through the corridors out into the main lobby by the front door, now encrusted with grime and filth. This hotel must have been grand once, with wide rooms and high ceilings. The main lobby has a huge spiral staircase leading to the upper floors. A smashed-up chandelier lies on the floor in the middle of the lobby. Broken glass, smashed plates and crockery cover the carpet. Furniture from the hotel bedrooms has been lobbed down from the upper floors too, 
adding to the debris. The decor is really old, really 1960s with floral wallpaper and a deep red carpet, dark wood and lots of brass fittings everywhere. Staying together, we work our way into a long ballroom with wooden floors and stacks of chairs piled up along the sides. An old bar stands at one end, still with some glasses stacked on the shelves. Dave and Clarence both scan the floor, pointing out fresh tread marks distinctive in the dust. Someone definitely came through her very recently. Looks like they went through here and into the lobby, Clarence comments, squatting down to look at the marks. Upstairs, I ask him and Dave. This place is huge, it could be anywhere, Nick says, his muted tone matching the gloomy interior of the hotel. If he's in here at all, Dave says, his eyes tracking all parts of the room. Back in the lobby, we realise there are two more corridors leading off from the ground floor, plus the ballroom that I assume leads into the kitchens and back room areas. Shall we split up? Cookie says. No, mate, it's almost dark now. It'll be pitch black in a minute and we'll end up shooting each other, I reply. We'll stick together. Let's try upstairs. There's on the back of my neck are standing up, Nick mutters. It's fucking creepy, Blowers adds in confirmation. I feel it too, that something isn't right, but we know we have no choice now. We can't risk being out on the street with just axes and limited rounds in the pistols. The shotguns are good, but they take vital seconds to reload between shots, and there's only six of us this time, and no automatic weapons. Dave takes point and starts leading us up the stairs, his knives already drawn and held one in each hand, the blades reversed and resting against his forearms. Clarence brings up the rear, his axe held ready. We're all tensed and ready, mouths open and heads cocked, listening intently. Reaching the first floor, Dave pauses and points to the two corridors leading off, one on each side. We wait for a few seconds, listening for any noises. We can split into two teams here, check each corridor and meet back in the middle. Dave and Nick, you're with me. Clarence, you take the other side, I instruct in a low whisper. They nod back. Clarence moves away with Blowers and Cookie behind him. Nick, you stay in the middle. Dave takes point and I'll bring up the rear. Dave nods and sets off, taking each step carefully. The sun is rapidly going down and the lack of external windows in the corridor makes it very dark already. Nick, have you got a torch in your bag? Dave asks, his voice very soft. Hang on, Nick whispers. Stay there, Nick. I'll do it. I step forward and open the top of his bag, carefully pulling the shotgun out and handing it over before I start rooting round. I don't want to press the trigger by mistake. My fingers close round a cold metallic object and I pull out a flashlight, small but with a powerful LED light. Keep it off unless we hear something and don't shine it in my eyes, or your own, or Mr Howie's, Dave instructs quietly. The corridor has hotel rooms on both sides, staggered all the way down. The first is on the right. Dave reaches it and pauses, listening before trying the handle. The door opens easily enough, and he darts in. Nick waits in the doorway, and I keep watch in the corridor, my axe grasped tightly in both hands. We go from room to room, Dave checking each one and leaving the door open once finished. In the last room, Dave enters then emerges almost immediately with a look of alarm on his face. Back to the middle, quick, he mutters urgently. We jog back to find Clarence and the other two coming out of their corridor. Did you see them? Clarence asks with concern. I did. Look down there, Dave replies, pointing out of the window down to the street. He's fucking trapped us, I say in shock at the sight of zombies shuffling across the road towards the hotel. There's fucking loads of them, Blowers says through gritted teeth. Shit, here they go, I murmur needlessly. We can all see they've frozen on the spot with heads turned up to the now darkened sky. The howling splits the night air and we freeze as the unmistakable sound is echoed from deep within the hotel. There are several of them by the sounds of it, but the noises from outside and the old-fashioned layout of the building makes it impossible to pinpoint the exact direction of the sounds. My heart rate increases, and I feel a surge of adrenaline coursing through me. That all-too-familiar sensation I get before a fight commences. 
Staring back outside, I see Darren standing in the road, roaring into the air. He stops and looks up at us. Without thinking, I draw my pistol and fire through the window, just missing as he ducks down out of sight. I know what I've done as soon as I pull the trigger. Fuck it, I'm so sorry. I apologise, knowing the shot will bring them all in our direction. Forget it, I was going for mine too, Clarence rumbles. Me too, Nick adds. My fault for leading you in here, Dave says flatly. You didn't, I did. and You said he could have gone over the wall or round the other side, I reply. All of us try to make each other feel better. Well, I blame Cookie, Blower says. I can't help but chuckle quietly. Cookie, this is your fault, I say to him. Sorry, Mr. Howie, it won't happen again, Cookie replies quickly. Yes, well, I'm making a note of it for your yearly appraisal, I say in a mock officious tone. Well, I guess we'd better find somewhere to hold up. Top floor? At least we get a nice view then, Clarence suggests. Why not? Top floor it is. Dave takes point and we follow him up the spiral staircase, going slower now because of the dark. Bangs and scrapes sound out all over the building, and my already strained nerves are straining even more than normal. Second floor and Dave pauses, staring hard at the entrance to the darkened corridor. Just before I hear the fast footsteps, he's already away, running to the entrance and stepping to the side just as a naked undead comes flying out of the shadows, his teeth already bared. Dave steps up behind him and slices through his neck with ease. The undead goes down noisily, crashing down the stairs and tumbling to the floor below. Stop staring at his arse, Cookie, Blowers remarks as the almost decapitated corpse tumbles past them. We follow Dave up the stairs, going faster now. Clarence at the back. I hear footsteps and a low growl and turn to see an undead running up the stairs at us. Clarence holds for a second, then steps in, sweeping his axe round and driving the undead over the low wall and crashing down into the chandelier on the ground level. I lean over and catch a glimpse of many figures running across the lobby towards the base of the stairs, the moonlight shining on their pale skin. Fucking shift it, loads of them coming, I say loudly. Dave increases his pace, with us following in his wake. We reach the third floor landing as an undead comes out of the corridor. Dave doesn't even break his stride, lashing out with one blade to sever through the throat and kicking the zombie back down the corridor. A dark spray of blood arcs into the air as he falls. I'm not built for running. Clarence rumbles behind me, his breathing sounding laboured. Almost there, Dave calls back. At the top, I can see the landing is well illuminated from the unobstructed moon shining through the windows. Hold here. Blowers and Cookie, you take the left corridor. Nick and Dave take the right. Clarence, you and me will take the top of the stairs. They shout affirmations back at me. Use the shotguns down the corridor. One fires and one loads, Dave calls out, heading over to his corridor entrance with Nick. I drop my bag on the floor, quickly pulling the shotgun and cartridges out while Clarence covers me. I finish and take over, holding central position and listening to them thundering up the stairs. Low growls, groans and snarls rise up ahead of them, adding to the already terrifying atmosphere. Contact! Blowers shouts before unloading both barrels down the corridor. The sound is immense and booms out into the quiet building. The first undead turns the corner of the curved staircase, his rotting face glinting in the pale moonlight. He snarls and bursts towards me with a fresh surge of energy, then loses his head as I swing out and take him clean through the neck. I shove out with my foot and send his cadaver thumping down the stairs, his body crashing into the undead following in his wake, knocking them flying to both sides like bowling pins. Clarence joins me, and I move over so we have an equal share at the top of the staircase. Shots indicate they're attacking in the corridors at the same time as the staircase. More reach the top and Clarence and I both swing out, striking into them and chopping through their bones like a hot knife through butter. Our axes almost clash as we swing, the long handles proving to be unwieldy for two men standing so close together. Keep going! Stepping back, I shout at Clarence. He shifts position to stand in the centre, already making use of the increased space and taking wider swings with his axe. I drop my axe and take up both shotguns. Leaning over the banister, I point the shotguns, one in each hand, down at the staircase. 
Four shots is all I have, and I take them quickly, each one booming out in quick succession. The effect is awesome. The reduced length of the barrel means the pellets spread out quickly and from this range the zombies are cut to pieces. Firing down onto them also means the pellets strike their heads first, exploding skulls and smashing brains apart. The bodies fall back down the stairs, straight into the path of the zombies still coming up. They stagger over their fallen undead while I drop down and break each gun to reload the four barrels, snapping them back together and leaning over to fire again. A few get through and are quickly sent packing by Clarence's almighty swings. I glance up while reloading and see him take a massive uppercut, driving the blade into the groin and nearly splitting the body in half through to the shoulders. He roars as he pulls the axe back out and swings again. Steady shots from both sides of me indicate they're getting multiple contacts from the corridors too. There's too many, Blower shouts loudly. I stand up, snapping both my guns shut and run towards them, diving down to stretch both hands through the gap between their legs. I unload the four barrels down the corridor and see the thick, oncoming horde being blasted backwards. I shuffle out and move back to the bags, reloading the shotguns as fast as my hands will allow. Dave, are you clear down there? I shout over. We can be, do you want it cleared? He yells back. The other corridor's thick with them, we need to move out. Got it. Hold your fire, Nick. Glancing up, I see Dave drop his shotgun and draw his knives before running into the corridor. Thumps and bangs mark his progress as he slaughters undead with graceful ease. Nick stands there holding his shotgun, his mouth hanging open. Nick, support the other side, I shout. He snaps to attention and runs over to help Blowers and Cookie. I lean over the wall just in time to see the stairs are thick with undead and Clarence struggling to hold them from gaining the top. I unload the barrels into them and watch with satisfaction as many are blown away, but it's not enough and they're quickly replaced with more growling, snarling beasts. Dave, are you clear? I shout. Clear, he yells back. Fall back to Dave's corridor, I shout after reloading both shotguns. Clarence turns and scoops up both our bags, then, brandishing the axe with one hand, he takes another mighty sweep through the heads of the front row of zombies, cleaving their skulls open. I drop back to the corridor and turn to face out. Now! I bellow. Blowers, Cookie and Nick all turn to run past me. Clarence roars as he takes another sweep, then quickly backs away, going into the corridor. I aim one shotgun at the staircase and the other at the mouth of the other corridor. Pausing just long enough for them to come through, I fire both guns with both barrels and snarl with satisfaction as I see them blown backwards. Fall back! Dave shouts behind me. I move into the corridor and run down a few metres. Clarence is now at the front, giving protection from anything coming up. Dave fires his shotgun, one barrel in each direction. Blowers steps in front of him and repeats the action, followed by Nick and Cookie. Find a clear room! Dave yells. I've just reloaded both my guns and I push the closet door open. Luckily the door swings straight into the male zombie standing behind it, causing him to stagger back slightly. I fire one barrel into his face and pull the door closed before moving down the corridor to try the next one. This time I kick the door open and see two undead inside. They get the remaining three barrels and the faded floral wallpaper is freshly layered with zombie gore. The door is pulled closed and I drop down to quickly reload the shotguns. Clarence roars and I glance up to see him standing at the end of the corridor, chopping undead down as they surge from another staircase. Constant shots from the other end tell me they're still busy too. With both guns reloaded, I try the next door. Nothing apparent, so I enter the large room. An old bed frame, side cabinets and a dressing table. Two doors in the wall. I kick the first one open and step back. Bathroom, all clear. The second door leads to an adjoining room, also clear. I head back to the corridor and deliver the news at the top of my voice. Cover me, Clarence shouts. I move in his direction while he backs towards me. We pass each other and I fire two barrels at the advancing undead while moving backwards. Dave orders the others to drop back while he covers them. Blowers, Cookie and Nick move down the corridor and enter the room. I pause in the doorway watching Clarence run into the adjoining room and lug the old bed frame across to the external door, wedging it tight.
A quick check down the corridor reveals more undead coming towards me. I fire down at them and remember Chris's words about how devastating these weapons are at close range. Clear, Clarence shouts. Dave, fall back, I yell out as Nick joins me in the corridor, firing his now reloaded shotgun into the horde. Dave drops back quickly and chucks his shotgun into the room before shoving a flashlight into his mouth and drawing his knives. He runs back up the corridor before I can say anything and commences a 30-second killing spree, the torchlight dancing about as he spins, drops and leaps in the darkened corridor. Blowers and Cookie step out, see Dave and turn to fire their weapons down the corridor. The light dances down towards us as Dave runs back, removing the flashlight from his mouth as he enters the room. Better now? I ask him, pointedly. Much better, thank you. He smiles back at me as Blowers slams the door shut. We quickly push the old furniture against the door. Me, Dave and Nick in this room and the other three in the adjoining room. We all step back at the same time, staring at each other through the connecting door, chests heaving and smiling like idiots. Fuck me, that was intense, Blowers mutters. We're in a hotel, not tents, Nick quips back. Very funny, Captain Blackbeard, what now? Blowers asks. Eat, drink and be merry, Clarence calls from the other room. For tonight, we fight. He makes his voice even deeper than normal, sounding like a Hollywood voiceover man. The guns are reloaded quickly, and we take the opportunity to do as Clarence jokingly suggested. We drink water and eat food taken from the stores back in the fort, and use antibacterial wet wipes to clean ourselves down. Thumps and bangs come from behind both doors, but the furniture is wedged in tight, and it will take them a while to beat their way through. Nice view, Cookie remarks, finding the balcony door and looking down the hill at the sea. Have you seen more naked men? Blowers asks. Fuck you, Blowers, but shit, take a look at that lot. We join him out on the balcony and look down to see the hotel is surrounded by thick crowds of zombies. Stitched up like a kipper, I mutter. What? Dave asks. It's a saying, I answer him. Oh, do kippers get stitched up then? I don't know, do they? I ask to shakes of heads and shrugs of shoulders. Looking down the hill, I can see the inky black of the water. But where this would have once been clearly defined by the lights of the mainland, it's now completely black. The only lights are the flashing green and red buoys in the sea. Staring down at the zombies surrounding us, a thought process forms in my mind. They must be locked out. The others look at me. This hotel is huge and they could easily fit inside. Good spot, Clarence says. That means we've got a finite amount in here with us. If I'm right, I reply quickly. I think you are, Dave says. They're not going anywhere, just waiting. He nods down at the ground as he speaks. So Smithy did trap us then, Nick says, giving voice to all our thoughts. He put them zombies in the rooms, led us up here, let more in, and then shut the doors so we can't get out. Clever fucker, I murmur. I bet he's nearby watching. Or he's done it to buy time so he can find our group before we do, Dave adds. If we've got no idea where they went, how will he know? Cookie asks. But if he's got control over the other zombies, couldn't he tap into what they've seen or heard? Maybe some of them saw our group moving about, Nick says. Why set the trap for us then, if he knew where they were? He could have taken this lot and gone straight for them, like he did with us in the fort, I say. So he set the trap for us to buy himself time to find them, Nick asks. Most likely, Dave answers, and coming from him, we accept the glimmer of hope that Darren hasn't figured out where they are yet. Options. We fight our way out, but that means taking on that lot in the corridor and then those outside and any others we find on the streets, or we try and sit it out for a few hours. I think we should wait, Mr Howie, Dave says firmly. If Darren knew where they were, then he wouldn't have set this trap. He would have gone for them straight away and not wasted resources by throwing this lot against us. We could fight our way out easily enough, but then we'd be running and fighting all night. Everyone agreed? Nods all round. Right, we'll do that. Sit and rest until either those doors give or daylight comes. Whichever is sooner. 10.
This feels wonderful. Completely wonderful. The world has gone to rat shit and everyone is either turned into a zombie or is hiding away with their heads under the bed sheets. Not me though. Not now. I can walk these streets with impunity. Nothing can touch me now. I've no doubt that Howie and that cunt runt Dave could fight their way out of the hotel, but that would leave them stranded on the streets in a strange place with no idea where to go and the area crawling with my charged up lovelies. No, they'll stay there, tucked up safe and sound, buying me a few hours of darkness to figure out where those fucking piggies went. Walking along a side street, I come out into the town centre, another steep hill, but this one full of shops and pubs. The pier is at the bottom of this street and the whole area is covered with bodies. Stacks of bodies. There's loads of pubs here, so I figured that the town must have been packed when it all started. Seeing the bodies rotting on the street makes me tut. What a waste of perfectly good bodies that I could have used. The smell of death is different to that of my brothers and sisters. Sure, they smell rotten and rancid, but not dead. The difference is clearly distinct. Still, the stench doesn't bother me. It's quite nice, really. The weather is warm. Howie and his cunts are having a stressful time, and I'm wandering the streets hunting for his little bum chums. Thanks to fuckwit Howie giving the game away, I can safely assume he did send them over here. The speed in which they got over the water tells me they're worried, but also that they don't know where they went either. Otherwise, they wouldn't be charging around after me and stopping to have a scrap. So they don't know where they went, and I don't know where they went. So where did they go? There must have been quite a few of them, so they would need somewhere big enough to hide away. Why doesn't Howie know where they are, though? He must have figured we'd get the information if we caught them, or tap into their cerebral knowledge with our amazing zombie powers. Fuck, I wish I had those powers back. That old boy was connected to me. It must have been because I bit him. I need to find some more survivors so I can bite them and have them under my control too. The cellar under the hotel. That's full of stupid panicking survivors. But all my babies are busy and it would mean doing it all myself. Still, it's only just got dark and I've got a few hours to kill. (laughs) Ha! Hours to kill. I make myself laugh. Fucking cunts, hiding away while I'm up here doing all the work, struggling them for what, I ask you, for nothing. That's what, fucking wankers, they deserve to die, sitting down there eating shit and drinking piss and making that old man come out on his own. Fucking cowards, I saw them throw him out. Poor old boy was terrified too. Yeah, they should suffer. There's a big pub here with large plate glass windows. One of them modern things that doesn't play music, but where everyone sits down pretending to be smart and clever. Fuckwits, fucking fuckwits. I wish they were here now so I could rip their faces off with my teeth. Behind the bar, I grab a couple of bottles of spirits and head back down the road, stopping to tear a strip off some already half-naked dead woman reveller. Fucking slut running around with her tits bouncing about and flashing her thong about. Yeah, not so hot now, are you? I spit on her face to show my distaste for her choice of skimpy clothing. Spittle lands obscenely on her cheek and starts sliding down. The material won't tear and I get frustrated, kicking her in her already decomposing stomach. The skin rips apart and covers my shoes and her filthy, stinking innards. Fucking whore. I spit down again and wipe my dirty shoes on her face and hair. The next corpse yields his top easily enough as I yank it from him and set off back down the street towards the seafront. At the bottom, a sign for a shop catches my eye and makes me turn back. A newsagent's and convenience store, with a sign advertising local guidebooks. I scoot over and find it's already been well looted with crap and debris all over the floor. Messy fuckers, I tut again as I work my way to the back where the magazines are displayed. I see the thick fucking looters didn't take any reading material with them. That's the problem with this country, distinct lack of education, I mutter to myself as I root through the shitty little pamphlets. I blame the parents myself. Ah, what's this? What's this? I pick up a local guidebook and start flicking through, but it's too dark for even my supercharged, wonderfully infected, lovely red bloodshot zombie eyes to read. 
Outside in the moonlight, I flick through the pages as I walk along the promenade and back towards the hotel with the cellar full of my supper. Stupid fucking book is full of wanky adverts, telling me where to eat and what shop to get my clothes from, telling me I can get two meals for the price of one on Tuesdays between 2pm and 2.05pm. Fucking cunts. That's what ruined this world. Stupid fucking adverts written by stupid fuckwits. And education, of course. No wonder we had to take over. Saving the world is what we're doing, really. Fuck, it would be ruined if left to these stupid cheese eaters, blowing each other up and boring everyone to death. Look at it now. It's Saturday night on a midsummer evening and I'm in a holiday town filled with pubs and not a fight in sight. Much better. Mrs Miggins could safely walk her dog through here. Well, if she was a zombie walking a zombie dog, she could anyway. Can dogs get infected? Fuck it, I'll try when I find one. I hate dogs. Nasty fucking things with big teeth showing off because they can piss up things and shit where they want. Reaching the railing, I tuck the tour guide into my waistband and stare down at the cellar door before easing the gate open and sneaking down the stairs. I empty both bottles of spirits onto the ground and slink back up a few steps, stopping to soak the material in the liquid. At the top... I move round so I'm closer to the main door and light the material with the lighter I sourced earlier. It flames instantly, so I drop it over the railings and watch as the flammable liquid ignites. Chuckling to myself, I run up the stairs and back through the hotel door, working my way back through the corridor towards the other cellar door. It's pitch black in here, but that suits me perfectly. I find the door and wait for a few seconds until I hear the low murmurs, then the raised voices and finally the panicked screams and shouts as they realise one of their exits is on fire. The place must be full of smoke already because I can hear loads of coughing coming from down there. They're arguing and trying to figure out what they should do. Someone shouts to get out. Someone else shouts it could be a trap. The first one shouts it doesn't matter if they all get burnt to death. That seems to do the trick. And the next noise is people thundering up the stairs towards the door I'm standing behind. The door swings open and the first one staggers out, coughing hard. Smoke is pouring out of the cellar, which is wonderful, as it will mask my presence and make it more confusing. I slip out from behind the door and my eyes pick up the silhouette of a figure, bent over and coughing hard. I slip in behind them and ease them away. Come on, quick! I say with pretend concern. The figure, a woman by the feel of the fleshy mounds hanging down from inside her top, responds easily enough and lets me lead her away a few metres. I clamp my hand over her mouth, nice and hard, and take a chunk out of the back of her neck, tearing the flesh apart and sucking on the blood. She squirms and tries to fight, but it only takes seconds before she slumps down to the ground. I go back towards the door and find someone else staggering about blindly and coughing. The trick works again, and I lead this one a few metres until he trips over the body on the floor and falls down. I land on top of him, scrabbling to cover his mouth while I gnash my teeth into his stomach. I bite down and savage through the flesh. He screams loudly and I hear more people running my way. I jump and shout, ''Quick, he's fallen over!'' They come running in and everything erupts into sweet bedlam with me tearing at their flesh and dragging them down onto the floor. The smoke, their eyes stinging and watering and the almost pitch black of the corridor makes it impossible for them to see and I take full advantage of it. It's over in minutes. A few escaped, but I bit a couple of those that ran off, so I know they'll turn soon. Leaving my bodies in the corridor, I descend the stairs into the cellar and find it's a disused bar, like a speakeasy from the movies. Wooden bar, wooden tables and wooden chairs and even old beer mats on the bar top. Signs of the survivors are everywhere, with stacks of tinned food, bottles of water and buckets overflowing with shit and piss. Dirty fuckers, how can they live like this? I've done them a favour, really, bringing them over to my side. Better than living in this filth. The fire has taken hold over by the door and the whole place is filled with thick smoke. Good job I'm not living, otherwise this would kill me. But even in my dead state I find it choking. 
A whimper makes me turn and head behind the bar to find a body tucked up in the fetal position. Must have crawled in here to die rather than face the terror outside. The body whimpers again, long curly black hair covering a face and the gentle curves of a womanly form. I gently push the hair away and see a beautiful face, soft red lips and dark eyes framed by arching black eyebrows. Stunning woman. Beautiful, really. I gaze down at her for a few minutes until I realise the smoke and flames will overpower even me if I'm not careful. She's alive. Barely. And I'm captivated by her exquisite beauty. I can't leave her here to die. No way. She's coming with me. I scoop her up in my arms, carry her out from behind the bar and up the stairs, back into the darkened corridor. My new converts are waking up, groaning and mumbling away like the hungry little blighters they are. Carrying the woman, I go back through the corridors and out the front door. The escaping survivors came this way too. I can smell them. Once outside, I can see thick smoke billowing up from the cellar. I carry the woman to the wide pavement and gently lay her down on the ground. She makes small noises in her throat as I smooth her hair back and stroke her gorgeous face. She's dressed in a filthy white blouse and black skirt. She must have been waitressing in the hotel when it happened. My undead heart hammers in my infected chest at the sight of her and the thought that I can bite this wonderful creature and take her blood. The newly undead circle around me clearly sensing she's still human, but I growl up at them, marking my territory, and they cower back. I can feel a connection with them which confirms what happened with the old boy. Seems I can keep what I bite. And biting this woman fills me with a sensual excitement. Surely nothing could be more intimate than sharing my blood with her so she can turn and join me. I lean down and hover over her skin, the smell of stale body odour, piss and shit is like perfume to me and I hold off biting her, drawing the torture out like I did with the old man, but this is way more torturous and exciting. My lips brush the side of her neck, then her cheek and her ear. I move down to her bare arms and feel the rush inside me. I don't want to mark her. She's too beautiful. With loving care, I roll her onto her front and unzip the back of her skirt, the action just excites me even more and it gets worse when I tug her skirt down to reveal her perfect tanned bottom. Ah, oh, the smell of shit is strong here. So strong and the sight of her firm cheeks makes my mouth drool until strands of saliva are spooling down to glide down her skin and soak into her panties. My tongue darts out to lick her skin. It's too much, and I can't hold back anymore. She comes to as I bite down, not too hard, but enough to break the skin and feel her beautiful blood flow into my mouth. Her back arches and her hands claw at the pavement. I know it hurts my beauty, but it'll be over soon, I promise. I bite down harder, unable to contain myself. The urge to burrow my head into her soft ass cheeks is so powerful. I want to eat her all up and have her inside me all the time. But I force myself to pull back. My head spins from the satisfaction and I lie on my back staring at the stars in an almost post-coital ecstasy. Raising my head, I look over at the massive flames now licking up from the basement. The cellar must be completely alight now. Oops, I giggle quietly. Sorry about your hotel. I look over and realise my beauty is still lying there, showing her ass off to the world and my hungry babies are edging closer. Fuck off, you dirty cunts! I snarl at them. Dirty, nasty fucking cunts! I'm on my feet, beating them about the head. They cower back, groaning softly as they're beaten by their master. Yeah, I'm their master now. Fuck you, Howie. You're not the only one with groupies. I drop down so I'm almost squatting on the backs of her thighs, staring down at her lovely ass and the rapidly congealing wound. Small rivers of blood run sexily down her skin and I can't help but drop down and lick at them, letting the metallic taste soak into my tongue. 
Pulling my head down, I gently run my fingers over the unbitten arse cheek, feeling the soft warmth. And by degrees, I increase the pressure until I'm kneading the flesh, taking a big handful and squeezing until she whimpers again. She suddenly comes to, flipping over onto her back and crabbing backwards. Her eyes are wide and fearful. She glances up at the zombie standing nearby and lets out a scream. Oh my God! She covers her mouth with her hand, glancing quickly between the zombies and me. She scuttles backwards until she's a few metres away, wincing as her wounded ass cheek touches the ground. She reaches down to feel and her hand comes away covered in blood. She keeps staring at the zombies and her breathing is hard and fast like she's hyperventilating. Did you know them? I ask softly. She doesn't answer, just stares at me, tears streaming down her face. It won't take long, I whisper to her. She looks terrified, truly terrified, and I almost feel sorry for putting her through this, but know she'll feel better in a few minutes. Am I... am I... She stammers between breaths. Yes, you're bitten. It won't take long. Just try and relax. She sobs hard, pitiful cries coming from her very soul. She scrabbles to her feet, holding the falling skirt up. No, no, please. She starts to back away. It's too late. I follow after her as she tries to run, limping and wincing with pain from her bitten bum. Please, no. She tries to run faster, but the infection is taking hold and she falls down onto the ground. I run to her side and try to cradle her in my arms. She fights back, screaming and beating at me with her fists. No, please, no! Her thrashing becomes feebler with every passing second until she gives up and lies still in my arms. Her eyes dart about as her breathing becomes more laboured. It's okay. It'll be okay. Just go with it. I stroke her hair and speak softly. Her dark eyes look up at me. Does it hurt? She whispers as she grips my arm. No, it doesn't hurt. It feels wonderful. Amazing. It's the best feeling ever. She's starting to slip now, fighting to stay awake, and I can see she's desperately clinging on to life and truly terrified of going under. Just relax. Don't fight it. It'll be over in seconds. She stares back at me, clearly delirious, but her words strike a chord in my heart. Promise? I promise. Stay with me. Her voice is barely a whisper. I remember how utterly terrified I was when they pulled me down in London. The thought of dying alone was unbearable and I too gripped at the zombie bodies and pulled them close, desperate for any action of embrace or words of comfort to ease my passing. With a final spasm, she passes away. Her dying breath eases out of her lips and she goes limp. I stroke her head as the flames grow ever bigger behind me, illuminating her in a soft orange glow. Minutes pass and I caress her soft face, so beautiful in death. Then it comes. She jerks slightly and goes still. Jerks again, and a spasm runs through her body like an electric current. She opens her eyes and stares straight up at me as I carry on stroking her face. Her eyes are red and bloodshot, and the effect just makes her look even more sultry and stunning. I promised it wouldn't hurt, didn't I? Stroking her soft face, I look down at the newest member of my horde. Her eyes fix on mine, her head not lolling, and her body no longer twitching with spasmodic jerks. Yes, you did, she replies. 11. They break through after a few hours, finally forcing the door open and using sheer body weight to push the barrier towards us. I've given up on this one, Clarence calls, running into our room. They're all pushing on this side, I reply, handing Clarence his shotgun. Keep it, I'll stick with the axe. Fair enough, big man. Walking forward, I lean over the barrier and shove the shotgun into the rapidly growing gap where the door is being pushed open. A zombie lunges in and tries biting the end of one of the guns. Four shots later, 
and there's a slight pause as the zombies not blown to bits lurch forward for another attack. I fucking love these guns, I shout as Blowers runs in and takes a shot, followed by Cookie, then Nick. Save the rounds, there can't be that many left, Dave says, and I suspect he's getting jealous at us racking the kills up with the sawn-off weapons. We've got loads of cartridges left, I smile at him. Yeah, but we don't know what we're going to meet or have to deal with and we might need them. Yeah, but there's loads of farms we can break into and I bet a rural place like this has loads of gunsmiths. Yeah, but we don't know if anyone has already been and taken them. Yeah, but it's fun. I like sawn off shotguns. He realises I'm pissing about and chooses to ignore me, focusing on the barrier slowly giving way and the increasing groans coming from the undead forcing their way in. The barrier finally collapses. The first couple of undead trip over the furniture and land heavily, but the rest surge through. Dave leaps into the fray before the rest of us have a chance to react. Knives drawn, he sets about them with his amazing agility. Clarence moves forward and stands nearby with his axe. But every time he goes to swipe at one, Dave nips in and takes it down. The rest of us stand and watch, mesmerised by Dave. He holds a central position, letting them come to him, but the way he flexes, stretches, drops down and pivots is extraordinary. I've lost count of the amount of times I've seen this, but it never ceases to amaze me and I don't think it ever will. A noise to my side. Nick lighting a cigarette. He shrugs at me and I shrug back. Watching them, it's almost comical. The huge figure of Clarence wielding a double-bladed axe and constantly trying to dart forward, and the much smaller figure of Dave slaughtering them with pathetic ease. Dave faints to the side, and one slips past him, only to be sliced in half by Clarence, taking his frustration out with a powerful swing. The bodies stack up on the floor, creating another barrier to the rest outside. Dave steps back for a rest while we watch the undead try to climb the bloody corpses and slip back down into the corridor. You missed one, Clarence states, very matter of fact. I let him through for you. You missed him. I knew you were there, so I let him through. I don't need your charity, Clarence growls. You were getting frustrated, so I let you have one. You let me have one. Clarence steps closer to Dave, staring down at the little man. Anger is an enemy and frustration causes mistakes, Dave replies, unflinching beneath the big man's intense gaze. What did you say? Clarence goes bright red and I see his already huge arm muscles bulge as he tenses up. Calm down, there's plenty left. Dave's tone strikes a chord and Clarence throws the axe down on the floor. Fuck me, the biggest man I've ever seen is about to have a fight with the most dangerous man I've ever seen. Nick and the other two keep glancing at me in alarm. Lads, take it easy. I adopt a friendly tone. They completely ignore me and stand with eyes locked. There can't be many men that can stare Clarence down, but Dave tries, maybe not even realising what he's doing. Clarence turns with incredible speed and pulls the barrier out of the way, then kicks at the stacked up corpses, sending them flying into the undead behind them. He roars and leaps over them and straight into the zombies, his fists flying out and battering them with savage brutality. Dave turns and watches, his face completely devoid of expression. Clarence rages, roaring with anger as he lashes out, punching with a staggering ferocity. He lashes backwards with his elbow, breaking the neck of an undead about to lunge at him from behind. He bends down and scoops up a body, then starts using it like a battering ram, swatting the other zombies with the corpse. His strong legs strike down as he stamps on heads, crushing skulls. Seconds later, it's over. Clarence scans the corridor and, seemingly satisfied, he drops the body and steps back into the room. Fuck me, we might as well go home, Cookie mutters quietly. You're right, mate? I drop back and speak quietly to Clarence, hopefully out of earshot of Dave at the front taking point as we make our way back down the stairs, carefully stepping over the bodies of the zombies we killed earlier. Fine. One word answer and I sense the brooding mood he's in. Dave takes some getting used to, but he's a good bloke. Okay. The tone is softer, relenting a little, and I leave it at that. Any more from me would risk being patronising to this highly trained soldier. 
The shotgun is now back in my bag, reluctantly put away so I can use the quieter axe if we find opposition. We make our way back down to the lobby and crouch down in the shadows, watching the silhouetted figures of the zombies outside. Rest here. The sun will be up soon and we can move out. I whisper quietly to Blowers. He repeats the instruction down the line until I see Dave nod back at me, then crouch down to rest his back against the wall. 12. You can speak? Yes. She looks up at me as I cradle her in my arms, and the only sign of the infection is the red eyes. My zombie mind whirls and spins, and I almost drop her in surprise. You were right. It feels fantastic. She purrs and snuggles her body closer to me. The pain is gone, and I feel all warm inside, warm and tingly. She lets out a low moan, and I can't help but stare at her. Although, if I'm honest, I do feel a little hungry. Very hungry, in fact. Her voice is soft and velvety, deep and sensual. Are you okay? She smiles up at me with straight white teeth, her pink tongue darting out to moisten her full red lips. How can you speak? I ask, and my tone is hard. Can't you all speak? She purrs. You know they can't speak. I'm the only one. You can't be the only one, she teases, tilting her face down and looking up at me through dark eyelashes. I thought I was, but now there's you. Her eyes lock on mine and I lose myself in their beauty, feeling her warm, dead body pressing close to mine. The hotel fire rages behind us, the light of the flames dancing across the road surface and glinting off the smashed up cars. Fragments of broken car windows scatter the ground, catching the light, dazzling and intoxicating. My lovelies gather round us, me and this beautiful zombie woman speaking so softly to me. My mind races as I try to think of how this has happened, how she can speak, why she is different like me. So many questions, so many things to think about, but for now I can't take my eyes off her. A chemistry ignites sparks between us. My zombie heart pounds as she grips my shoulders to lift herself up closer to my face. I lean down until we're just inches apart. Eyes locked. I want to kiss her. I want to bite her and taste her blood again. She feels the same. Her lips pull back and make ready for the bite, but then press together, readying for the kiss. We pucker and snarl as the conflicting urges surge through us. Bite, kiss, tear, caress. Our lips gently brush, so soft. Her grip intensifies on my shoulders as she bares her teeth and growls at me. I show mine and snarl back at her. Our lips constantly touch and break apart. My mouth brushes her warm cheek. Her grip softens, and I move down to gently brush against her neck. She stretches sensually as I nuzzle at her skin. Sensations sweep through me and I push my head down. She stretches harder as my teeth push down on the taut flesh. She groans and pulls me in, longing for me to bite her. She nestles round and pushes her mouth against my neck, gently kissing. Electric tingles run up and down my spine. Her kissing gets firmer. Harder. Teeth against my skin. A low groan escapes my throat as the pressure gets stronger. Her tongue flicks out, licking me. My head swims as she bites again, her teeth pushing in. My hand goes to the back of her head, pulling her closer. She responds and bites harder as I push her head against me, my fingers entwined in her soft hair. Her arms wrapped around my shoulders tighten and she bites down. I feel my skin tear as she pierces the flesh and her tongue licks at my infected blood. She groans louder and sucks my neck, drawing more blood into her mouth. The pain is ecstasy, pure ecstasy and like nothing I have ever felt before. My hand drops down to lift her bodily onto my lap. She straddles me. Her thighs wrap around my stomach as she licks and sucks hungrily at my neck. I drop my hand down and feel the firmness of her ass cheeks and her skirt rides up. Kneading and caressing, my hand touches the wound 
and she flinches. Sorry, I whisper into her ear. Touch it, she groans back at me. My hand moves round, slowly sweeping the curve of her rounded butt. Fingers brush against bare skin, probing, touching, feeling for the wound. She groans and licks at my neck. The tips of my fingers brush the wound. She pushes into me with whimpers of pleasure. Touch it, she says again. My fingers gently stroke the torn flesh going back and forth and she presses her body against mine. Again, she pleads. My fingers brush over the ragged wound, applying more pressure. Her body tenses and she moans. Harder, she begs. I respond and rub with force. She pushes into me, her body pulsating, thrusting, rocking. Harder, she commands. My hand grips and squeezes at the laceration. Her mouth locks onto my neck, sucking and licking. Her hot tongue probes my bitten flesh, easing the blood out. I feel the liquid drip down my neck, sending more shivers through me. The ecstasy builds as we thrust our bodies into each other. My hand roughly explores the moist, sticky hole in her ass. She pulls the collar of my shirt away from my neck, exposing my shoulder. She grips me with all her strength and buries her mouth onto my flesh, biting down, tearing at it. My body is on fire as the pressure builds. I move my free hand round to rub at her while I lift the first bloodied hand to my mouth, licking at the blood. She pulls away from my shoulder, hungrily sucks on my fingers, tasting her own blood. Eyes lock, chests heave as we pant, push eager fingers into open wounds, taste blood. There is only now, this moment. Our minds are as mingled and entwined as our blood. The pressure releases, our bodies are taut, straining with orgasm, shuddering, shaking and groaning with pure pleasure. I have no idea how long we are locked together. Seconds that seem like eternity. We lie on the road, side by side, bodies entwined, watching the hotel burn. It's beautiful, she says softly. What is? The fire. The power of it. It's beautiful. It is. Can it hurt us? Rolling onto her side, she faces me as she asks the question. Yes, anything can hurt us just the same as before, but we don't feel pain like we used to. Our injuries heal a lot faster. Our blood clots quicker and it takes more to kill us. What does kill us? They'll go for the head mainly, or a massive attack to the body, like chopping the legs off or splitting the stomach open. Who? Who's they? Survivors. Howie and his lot. I spit the words out with venom. Howie? He's a fucking wanker. Him and his cunt runt mate Dave. Who are they? She asks me. We lie together as I recount the journey, the story, the history of what happened, who they all are and why I'm here. My tale of woe takes a time to tell, but she listens intently. Squeezing my hand at the sad times, like when Howie abused me so badly on the bridge, and laughing at the good times, like when I killed Jamie and the old couple in the shop. It feels good to talk, and I realised how much I've missed being able to communicate like this. This makes me think again about why she's different. I don't know, she answers when I put the question to her. I woke up to find you groping my ass, you dirty man, she laughs. I remember the fear I felt at being bitten and recognising them too. She motions to the other zombies still gathered round us. I remember going under and being terrified, but then I was back and it felt different, completely different. Is that how it was for you? Exactly the same. They pinned me down and I was shitting myself, but then I came back. But it was different. There were thousands and thousands of them, and I controlled all of them. I could feel their connection in my mind and make them do what I wanted. As we came down from London to the fort, I could sense more of them joining us. Oh, you should have seen it. Our brothers and sisters as far as the eye could see. And you controlled all of them? Every single one. 
but I was the only one that could speak or think like this, or so I thought. You're special, unique, powerful. She purrs the words, caressing my arm. And now you're here. I turn to face her. And I wonder what for. I don't know. To help you? To help you stop that Howie and his nasty friends? Is that why? My gaze locks onto her face. Why else? Maybe you want to be in charge. Maybe I've failed and now you've been selected to take over. My voice grows harder as I speak. Yeah, I've failed and I'm not needed. Yes, but if he just fuck off and let someone else have a go, eh? Going to take over, are you? Come here to kill me, have you? I'm on my feet, raging and shouting at her. She looks alarmed and stands up, staring at me with her beautiful eyes. Yeah, trying to seduce me with your... your... your ass, thrusting your tits at me and making me have zombie sex with you. We didn't have sex. Well, whatever we did, it felt like sex. It was amazing. You were amazing. That's not the point. Don't try and woo me over with your womanly charms. Oh no, come in here to take me over and make me a slave like one of them. I point to the nearest zombie which drools away as it stares between the woman and I. I don't even know your name, I shout. It's Marcy, she laughs. My name is Marcy. What's yours? Smithy, did you say? Darren. It's Darren Smith. Everyone has always called me Smithy. Then I shall call you Darren. Stop putting me off when I'm ranting. Darren, my love, it's clear why I'm here. She walks towards me, stares up through those dark red eyes. My purpose is clear, my love. I'm here for you, to help you. I start to protest, but she moves in and puts her hand gently to my mouth. Why else would you have saved me from the fire? Why else would you have bitten me the way you did? You avoided my face and took me in the bum. I blanch at the expression she uses. She smiles back. Sorry, I meant bit me in the bum. You bit my bum. Bit it hard and took my blood. She whispers, and I feel the erotic sensation building up again. We stand close, breathing hard, and she licks the scabbed blood on my neck. Can we have sex? She asks me softly. Now, I reply, shocked. N no, I mean, can we? Can zombies have sex? She laughs, and the sound is music to my ears, like the strangulated death gurgle of a human. I don't know. My heart is hammering again. Does it work? She presses in closer, her hand dropping down to my groin. Oh, it works. It works very well. She pushes and rubs, building the tension. Shit, I exclaim. What's wrong? The sun's coming up. We've been here for hours. We need to move. She pulls back, staring at the sky. Follow me. I know where we can hide. She starts to pull me away. Hide? I'm not hiding from any fucker. I'm going after his little piggies, I argue back. Darren, they'll be out soon and they'll come looking for you. That will tell them you were here, she nods to the blazing building across the road. We need to rest, get more bodies and plan smartly. I bridle at the implication. She senses it. Darren, my sweet, you've done so well. You're so powerful and strong, but I believe I was put here to help you. We can plan together. Howie and his friends think you're going straight after the others and will follow you. They don't realise that you don't know where to find them either. So let's get there first so we can fuck them over. Darren, trust me, please. She looks into my eyes and my undead heart melts. I want Howie's piggies to die and suffer. I want that cunt sister of his to suffer the death of a thousand bites, but maybe she's right. So far I've been predictable, other than trapping them in the hotel, that is. The stupid fucktards, getting trapped by a zombie. Fuck you, Howie. I'm not just a zombie. I'm a super zombie.
Dragging my eyes from Marcy's, I gaze across the road at the blackened remnants of the burned-out hotel, then back at the beautiful zombie woman I rescued from it. I don't resist as she takes my hand and starts to pull me down the street. The latest recruits to our undead army trail loyally in our wake. Day 9 Saturday 1 Scarlett Johansson, definitely Scarlett Johansson, Blower states firmly. She's nice, but she's got a weird nose, Cookie replies. Weird nose my ass. she's gorgeous. Nah, I'm sticking with Angelina Jolie, Cookie sighs. Only because she gets her tits out in every bloody film she does, Blowers says. And that's a bad thing, how? Cookie asks. Kira Knightley, Nick adds. Too skinny and she does the same thing in every film, Blowers replies. She's a fitty, Nick says. Nope. I'm sticking with Scarlet, thank you very much. How about you, Mr Howie? Me? I reply. Well, I don't really fancy people off the telly, but if I had to, then it would be Monica Bellucci. Who's that? Nick asks. She's from The Matrix, Blowers replies. Which one? asks Nick, leaning forward to look down the line at Blowers. She was the one in the toilet telling Neo he had to kiss her like he kissed the other bird, Blowers explains. Oh, yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah, she was fit. Nick nods in agreement. She gets her boobs out quite a bit too, though, he adds. She's been in loads of things. Yeah, and she's getting on a bit now too, Cookie joins in. Still gorgeous, though, I add quietly. I wonder what they're all doing now, Nick says. They're all in a secure compound with all the other fit women being kept safe for the future of mankind. Cookie says the sniggers from the rest of us. Yet they need young virile lads like us to help repopulate the planet. More sniggers. Fuck the Isle of Wight then, let's go there, Nick says wistfully. Oh, can you imagine it? Blowers groans. You can't go, Blowers, Cookie says. Why not? Oh, don't start. Blowers groans louder this time to more sniggers from Nick and Cookie. Even Clarence smiles. You're going to an all-male compound across the road, Cookie smirks. What's that smell? I lift my head as a different odour penetrates the smug, fetid stench of stale sweat, decaying bodies and farts. It's Blowers getting excited, sir, Cookie says quickly. Burning, Dave says. It's the first time he's spoken since we came down and rested against the wall of the old decrepit hotel lobby, waiting for the sun to come up so we can safely beat through the hordes of undead stacked up outside. I can smell it too, Nick cranes his head forward, sniffing at the air. Is it this place? Blowers asks. I wouldn't put it past Smithy to set us on fire. No, it's coming from somewhere else. Clarence rumbles in his deep voice. Reminds me of barbecue smoke. I'm bloody starving. Nick inhales deeply, savouring the aroma. Sun's almost up. We should get ready. I climb to my feet and move stiffly over to the glass doors, peering over the heads of the deathly horde and down the hill to the now blue waters of the sea. Ah, another beautiful day in paradise. I stretch and yawn at the same time, leaning against the wall as I get a sudden head rush. I could murder a coffee, Clarence rumbles as he too gains his feet and stretches. I look over at the huge man and notice how he nods to Dave as he steps past him, a sign that the disagreement they had upstairs is done and finished. Dave has the sense to nod back, and once again, I wonder at how sometimes he can understand a subtle yet complicated social interaction, but other times he misses glaringly obvious ones. Shrugging, I turn back and watch as the sun's gorgeous rays start sweeping across the pavement and each zombie instantly slows to become a shambling mess as it gets caught in the pure light of day. Do you think UV light would do the same to them? I ask out loud. We should try it, Dave replies. They've shown they can switch between slow and fast during the day, but it might work. Good thinking, boss. Clarence says, stepping forward to join me as I look out through the filthy glass panes of the front door. 
Boss? Did he just call me boss? If it works, we could rig some up on the outside of the fort when we get back. Ha! A shitload of sunbeds all hanging down from the walls. That'd be cool. Cookie laughs, then looks sheepish as everyone else stays silent. Fuck it, I thought it was funny. It wasn't, Blowers says. Fuck you. Cookie pulls his bag on his back, adjusting the straps and bouncing up and down a few times to make sure everything is secure. He reaches one hand back to make sure he can grasp the stock of the shotgun. We all do the same, readying ourselves and helping each other to tighten straps. Working quietly, we all know the importance of being ready to move quickly and not risk our kit dropping out. Gathering at the front door with our axes in hand, apart from Dave, who still sticks with his double knives, we stand quietly waiting for something to happen. Uh, this door is locked, I say finally, remembering we came in through a back entrance. We all smirk sheepishly as we turn away from the door and start threading our way through the hotel ground floor. Reaching an old ballroom, we find one of the double fire doors closed from the inside with a locking metal bar. Blowers gets there first and starts pushing down on it, but the bar is rusted badly and sticks in place. Let me try. Cookie barges past and starts hitting down on the bar, desperate to outdo Blowers. Ha! Yeah, go on then, hero. Blowers laughs at Cookie, struggling. Clarence gives him a few more seconds, then coughs politely. Cookie glances round, then steps back and flourishes a hand at the door. Watch this, Blowers says as Clarence goes to push the bar down with one hand. Still, it refuses to budge, so he applies more pressure. Propping his axe against the wall, he uses both of his enormous hands to ram down on the bar, but still it holds. Clarence grunts with effort, then suddenly stops, takes a small step back and breathes in deeply. His shoulders relax, and I watch as he raises both his hands a few inches from the bar, then seems to explode with a sudden ferocity, sending both doors flying off the hinges to land a few feet away in the bushes outside. Fuck me, Nick says in awe. Doors open. Clarence rumbles, bending down to lift his axe. Good work, Clarence, Dave says. Thanks, Dave, Clarence replies. Blowers and I exchange a glance at the polite tones they use to each other, both of them clearly making an effort to show respect. I raise one eyebrow and give a little shrug before stepping out the door. We file out and work our way through the jungle of overgrown bushes to the gravel car park. The massed horde gathered on the road at the front of the hotel start to turn slowly and shuffle in our direction. Righto, let's have an early scrap and go for breakfast, I say lightheartedly. Or we could just skirt around them and go for breakfast now, Nick says, rubbing his stomach. Fuck me, look at that smoke. We turn to stare at blowers needlessly pointing down the hill at the thick plumes of smoke wafting up into the still morning air. Whatever it is on fire is hidden from view by the densely packed buildings. We've been here for one day and already things are on fire, I remark, shaking my head sadly. That's got to be Darren, blowers says quietly. Our small group pauses for a heartbeat as we all realise the implications of what blowers just said. As one, we start jogging out of the car park, all joking forgotten as the serious business of why we're here takes residence in our minds once more. The front of the horde have already reached the edge of the car park, but we keep to the far side and skirt round them quickly. Avoiding combat now for the sake of making distance and getting down the hill. Glancing over, I blanch at how many undead have gathered here during the night. The road in front of the hotel is thick with them. There must be hundreds all starting to shuffle towards us. Slack jaws, red bloodshot eyes and decaying grey skin almost hanging off their bones. They look withered and less human than ever before. The tattered clothing that still clings to some of them is filthy and the bloodstains have dried out to a sickening brown colour. Flies and insects buzz in and around the hundreds of raw and open wounds. The danger of disease from their dead flesh must almost be as bad as the infection inside them. The stiffness in my legs abates as I warm up and start jogging down the hill. All of us have the sense to take it steady instead of running hell for leather. 
The lessons we've learned over the last God knows how many days are what's kept us alive where many others have fallen. The muscles in my legs feel stronger, leaner, and my breathing has improved with the sheer amount of exercise I've had to do since all this started. Not a day has passed without some kind of frantic run, fight, battle, or chase. Blowers, Cookie, and Nick also look leaner and fitter. And despite the constant pissing about, they've hardened and carry the look of capable men. I glance over at Dave running by my side. His face looks the same. The only difference is his deep tan from so many days outside in the summer sun. Right now, at this point, I wouldn't swap or trade these men for anything in the world. There are no finer people to be with, and my only regret is that we lost many such good men outside the fort. The hill gets steeper as we descend, passing old, faded and battered-looking Victorian townhouses now converted into shitty flats with dirty windows. High-gloss paint peeling from the doors and frames. The smell of burning increases, and slowly we start to see the back of a huge building coming into view, smoke billowing out from the windows and roof. At the bottom of the hill, we turn right to see the front of a grand old Victorian hotel blazing away. Huge flames roaring as they eat into the building. Several bodies lay scattered about on the pavement, already smoking from the heat of the fire. Wait here! Ditching my axe, I run forward with my arm held up against the fierce heat. Reaching the first body, I kick it over, but the flesh is scorched and smouldering, rendering the face unrecognisable. I crouch down and crab over to the next one, rolling it over and staring down at the face. I don't recognise it, so I check the next few and find them in the same state. Not ours, I yell out as I reach the group, wiping the stinging sweat from my eyes. The relief is as clear on their faces as it must be on mine. They've got fresh bite marks on them. The blood is fresh too. Last night then, while we were kept busy up the road, Clarence says. I nod up at him. If he got our group, he would have left a message, Dave adds in his flat but firm voice. He'd want us to know we'd lost. This whole row will go, Nick points along the building line at all the big old houses and storefronts joined up along the esplanade. And behind, too. I fucking hope there's no survivors in them, Cookie mutters. There's nothing we can do. We should clear out before it attracts too much attention. I pick my axe up and cough from the cloying stench of burning chemicals in the air. Looking back up the hill, I see the thick horde slowly trailing down the hill after us. With a bit of luck, they will stop and stare in wonder at the bright, dancing flames. Which way? Cookie steps out into the road, looking left and right. Up there, Dave says quickly. He steps forward, peering towards the right-hand side, his eyes squinting as he examines something in the far distance. There's one moving away from us, going slowly, he explains. He must be following Darren. Enough said. We start jogging again, taking a wide arc past the front of the burning building and crossing over to the far side of the tree-lined pavement. I stare back at the raging inferno and think of how much destruction is being wrought on the world by a few desperate survivors clinging on to life. Our steady pace brings us closer and closer to the solitary undead limping along on a badly damaged leg. As we get closer, Dave waves his arm for us to slow down and signals us to be quiet indicating we should follow him. We don't know where they went, but neither does Darren, Dave whispers as we group in close to listen. He'll probably go to ground and wait for us to lead him. We follow that. He points at the limping zombie. And hopefully we get to him before he can do anything else. We're forced to walk painfully slowly as the undead struggles to shuffle on his clearly broken and mashed up leg. Going this slow gives me a chance to take in the surroundings. The debris littered about and the proper dead bodies decaying in the street. The nightclub above the bowling alley is just up ahead of us, and I can see some of these dead are still dressed in their nightclubbing clothes. I think back to the young woman in the blue dress that tried to bite me back in Borough Fair. Christ, that seems like years ago, but it's only been nine days. Do you reckon they got food in there? Nick asks, nodding towards the front of the bowling alley. The doors are smashed in, mate. Blowers replies quietly. It's already looted. Might be something left. I'm starving. We'll go and look, mate. We're all hungry. 
I motioned to Nick to follow me, nodding at Dave to make sure he's okay with it first. Nick and I sprint off to the left, leaving the group behind as we speed up and turn towards the front of the building. As we get close to the front, I look back to see the others still walking slowly and then judge the distance and how long it will take them to get past us. At the pace they're going, we could have a few games of tempin and still catch them up. We drop down to a steady walk as we near the front doors, and I bring my axe up to hold in both hands, watching Nick do the same. The doors are big wooden double doors, smashed and hanging from the hinges. We look down at the dried bloodstains smeared across the ground and disappearing under the next set of doors. The interior doors yield as I push them open, and we step gently into the slightly darker interior. Still early morning, and the sun hasn't risen fully yet, so the shadows in here are still long and dark. We step slowly, going past vending and gaming machines that look dark and lifeless without electricity powering through them. In front of us is the large square reception area with rows of red and white bowling shoes stacked up in various sizes. To the right is the cafe bar and restaurant, which is the direction our rumbling stomachs lead us. The bar and eating area are sectioned off by a high brown wooden wall with two swing doors, giving it a Wild West saloon look. I take point and push the doors, which creak ominously as they swing open. Nick steps through behind me and they swing closed, flapping noisily a couple of times. There is a long bar to the left, seating to the right, and the door leading to the kitchens is straight ahead. I nudge Nick and motion with my head towards the windows and the sight of the still limping zombie still struggling to get along outside. We stalk towards the doorway, taking each step slowly and straining our ears to listen for any noises. A few steps away from the door, it suddenly bursts open. A young Asian woman steps through quickly and stands facing us, a massive meat cleaver in her hands. Long dark hair scraped back into a ponytail frames a very pretty face. Her small build stands solidly. Her hands look steady as she holds the cleaver with a double grip. Eyes dart from me to Nick, then back again. She takes in the big axes, the shotgun stocks poking out the top of our rucksacks, but she doesn't show fear. If anything, she looks more resolute. Hey, I keep my tone light. Nick, back up, mate. I step back and hear Nick shuffling a few steps away. Sorry, we didn't realise anyone was here. We're just looking for some food. She stays silent, staring at Nick and then back at me. Those front doors aren't locked or secured. Anyone could get in here. She remains quiet. Only her eyes move. Listen... We're not a threat to you. We came here yesterday looking for survivors from our group, a load of women and children that might have come into the harbour on boats. She doesn't show any sign of listening. They might have had a few uniformed police officers with them. Still nothing. That's some of our group out there. I point out the window and watch her eyes dart over. A slight look of surprise crosses her face before she purposefully blanks it out and looks back at us. Okay, listen, my name is Howie, and this is Nick. We're from Fort Spitbank on the mainland. If you see our group, will you tell them it's safe to return now? Silence. Fair enough. We'll go. I don't know if you're alone or if others are with you, and I don't want to know, but there are hundreds of those things two minutes up that road. You need to get those doors secure. Maybe she doesn't speak English, Mr Howie. Her eyes flick to Nick as he speaks. Do you speak English? No. Okay, if you do understand me, then try and get across the water to Fort Spitbank. It's a safe place. Safer than here, anyway. If you do go, a big man called Chris will be there. Tell him you met Howie, and we're still looking for our group. Tell him Darren is over here. Got it? She doesn't respond, nor move an inch. Come on, let's go. Sir, Nick affirms. Sorry to disturb you, I say with a nod, and turn my back to start walking back to the swing doors, shaking my head at the sadness of it all. That's a pity, I'm bloody starving, Nick mutters as he pushes through the doors. We'll find somewhere else, mate. Wait! She calls out as we reach the exit door. We turn around to see her standing there, holding one side of the swing door open, the meat cleaver now down at her side. I saw them. She stares at us, her face still a mask. What? I saw them come from the harbour, women and children. There were lots of them. 
Her voice is confident Southern English. Where did they go? My voice is urgent. That way. She points in the same direction that the undead is slowly heading. Were they okay? They looked okay. They didn't hang around. Okay, any idea where they could have gone? She looks puzzled for a second. I mean, they'll go for somewhere safe that can hold that many people. I don't know, she says, shaking her head. Are you from here? Yeah. She nods once, still unsure. How many are in your group? She bites her bottom lip and hesitates. Listen, I promise we're not a threat to you. We were just looking for food while we trail that zombie. I point out to Dave and the others slowly ambling by. She steps forward to look past me through the doors and out into the road. Why? she asks. Long story. He might lead us to someone we need to... Uh, how do I explain about Darren without sounding like a nutcase? One of our lads got turned. He's different to the others, though. He can speak and think like normal. He's trying to find our group before we do. That thing might lead us to him. Nick cuts in explaining, and it doesn't sound so weird now. She nods, seeming to understand. It's just me, she says quickly. I mean, here, it's just me. Why did you come out then? This place is massive. You could have hidden or something, I ask her. I thought you were those things. It's daytime. They move slow in the day. Didn't you hear us talking? She shakes her head. And they don't always move slowly in the daytime. The risk was too great. You should have hidden until you knew what the threat was. We could have taken you and this place with ease the way you presented yourself like that. She stares at me defiantly, and I realise the tone of voice I used was one of authority. This woman doesn't know me. Who am I to tell her what to do? Sorry, I shouldn't have spoken to you like that. I apologise. It's okay, she mutters quietly. You could come with us if you want. I meant what I said about there being hundreds of those things up the road. If they get a whiff of you, they'll be in here quick as anything, and like I said, they don't always stay slow in the day. I make the offer, but despite her poker face, I can tell from spending so much time with Dave that she's worried. I'm Howie. This is Nick. You said that already, she replies with a half smile. Did I? Fair enough. What's your name? Milani. Lani. Nice to meet you, Lani. I nod at her. Is there any food here? Nick asks. I smile at the thought that he must be starving to keep asking. No, she shakes her head. Not really, anyway. Some crisps and things, but it all went off when the power went. Crisps will do. I'm bloody starving. Where are they? Can I go and get some? Nick asks in such a friendly tone that she smiles and nods. In the kitchen. Help yourself. She motions behind her through the bar. Is that okay, Mr Howie? Nick asks before scooting off through the swing doors. Get some for the others, but leave some for Lani here. Will do, Nick shouts. Lani, I meant what I said. You are welcome to come with us. You're local and we don't know anywhere around here. Some of our lads are ex-army and I guess what you're worried about, but I promise no one will touch you or try anything like that. Mentioning the thing that must be worrying her makes her react by lifting her head and staring at me defiantly again. I've got an idea. I put the axe down and reach back to draw my shotgun from the bag. She steps back a little at seeing the weapon in my hands. Don't worry, just hang on a second. I break the gun to show the cartridges in the barrels. It's loaded with two shells now. This is the safety switch here. Just slide it back and pull the trigger. The range isn't good, but at short range they're devastating. Here, you take it. I hold the weapon out with the stock presented to her. She frowns at the offer and hesitates before slowly stepping forward to take the weapon and holding it awkwardly in her hands. Please don't point it at anyone unless you mean to shoot them and make sure the safety is on. We only use them when we have to. The noise draws them from bloody everywhere. What about you? She asks, nodding at the axe. I've got this and a pistol. I draw the pistol from the holster in the middle of my back, then realise it might be easier for her to carry that instead of the shotgun. You can have this instead if you want. They kick like a mule, though, and unless you shoot them in the head, they're no good. No, this is fine, thank you. 
Her manner is instantly different, her tone less defensive now she's holding a decent weapon. Nick comes back through the swing doors, the axe wedged under his arm as he stuffs bags of crisps and peanuts into his bag. I've got some water too, oh! He comes up short as Lani turns to him holding the shotgun down at her side. I gave it to her, Nick. Fair enough. Do you need some shells? I've got loads. He drops the bag and starts rummaging about before pulling out a handful of shotgun cartridges. Do you know how to load it? Nick asks as she takes the cartridges and starts stuffing them into the pockets of her jeans. I watch for a few seconds as Nick shows her how to break the weapon and reload cartridges into the breech. She nods as the friendly lad chats amiably, the tension slowly easing away. Everything all right, Mr. Howie? Dave asks, silently stepping through the door behind me. Fine, mate. Lani, this is Dave. Dave, this is Lani. Nice to meet you, miss. Dave nods as though it's the most normal thing in the world to see a woman holding a shotgun in a bowling alley in the middle of a zombie apocalypse. Is she coming with us? He asks in his usual blunt manner. I've offered, mate. Lani? We could do with the local knowledge and you'll be safer with us than here on your own. Yeah, right, after all the scraps we've had already. Nick laughs, then cuts himself off. Sorry, I didn't mean it like that, he adds to the young woman. Just stand next to him and nothing will touch you. He nods at Dave, who just stares without expression. Or the big bloke with the bald head. Actually, if you stand between them, then you'll probably be the safest person in the entire world. He gabbles on as she looks at him with a puzzled expression. Did you get any food? Blowers asks as he and Cookie step into the foyer behind Dave. Why are we all here? I turn to ask them. That thing is going so slowly, Mr. Howie. Clarence said he'd stay with him and we're starving. Oh, hello. Blower stops as he sees Lani and I notice Cookie gives her a big smile. Lani, this is Blowers and Cookie. She was in here when we came in. Nice meat cleaver, Cookie smiles. Here! Nick throws a bag of crisps at Cookie's head, causing him to jump back, laughing. Ah, oh, nice one, mate, Cookie exclaims. Nick throws another one to Blowers, who rips the bag open and starts eating quickly. Is that your shotgun, Mr. Howie? Blowers asks with a mouthful of food. Yes, mate, she only had the meat cleaver. Fair one, you'll need it, Blowers says to her. There's shitloads of them up there. He nods back along the way we just came. You coming with us? Cookie swallows a mouthful of crisps and asks the question before stuffing another handful in his mouth. I, uh... She seems overwhelmed at the sight of the men suddenly in her safe place, armed to the teeth and dressed in half-military gear. I've offered, I explain. You should come with us, Blowers says. It'd be nice to have someone other than this knob to talk to, he adds as Cookie splutters with indignation. The two lads step forward and grab more crisps from Nick's bag. Cookie offers one to Lani, who declines politely. Within a couple of seconds, the three lads are standing round her, chatting amiably as they munch food, their relaxed banter putting her visibly at ease. We'd better join Clarence before this lot eat all the food. Lani, we'd be more than happy to have you with us. If that's okay, she nods, smiling for the first time. Of course. Do you need to get anything? Just my bag. It's in the kitchen. She starts walking back through the swing doors. I'll come with you. Nick and the other two start going after her. I'll go, Nick says to Blowers and Cookie. No, mate, you've done plenty of running about. Just relax, Blowers says as Cookie speeds up to go past them both. The three of them jostle through the doors, following the pretty girl as I shake my head at Dave. Well, she's got a bodyguard now, I mutter. Yes, Mr. Howie. So you and Clarence okay now? Yes, Mr. Howie. Sorry about that. You don't have to apologise, Dave. Won't happen again, he adds. It might do. Just as long as we know why we're here and what we've got to do, we can all fall out as much as we like. In fact, it's bound to happen. But the end goal is the most important thing. He stares at me keenly. What? I ask him. Nothing, Mr. Howie he says flatly, but holds that gaze for another second before looking away with a very small, wry smile. Are you smiling? I ask him, shocked at the highly unusual expression. Sorry, 
I didn't mean it's a... Don't start with the sir stuff. What were you smiling about? Just what you said. You sound like a proper officer now, Mr Howie. I'm not an officer, Dave. I'm a supermarket manager. You were a supermarket manager, and you're right. You're not an officer, he accepts, then looks back at me with that same keen look. You're a leader now, and that's what officers were meant to do. Lead. Ah, piss off, Dave. Fuck me, mate. We worked in the same supermarket. I feel uncomfortable at the comments he makes. Different world, Mr Howie. There's only here and now. Thankfully, we're interrupted by the return of the others coming through the swing doors, and I notice Lani has a small, brightly coloured rucksack on her back, too small for the shotgun to rest in, so she holds it in one hand with the meat cleaver in the other. Dave, I found these. Any good? Blowers crouches down and rolls out a chef's knife holder full of black-handled, deadly-looking knives. Dave is on them instantly, drawing each one out and checking the length of the blade, the sharpness, the balance and the weight. He discards most of them, but leaves two long straight bladed knives similar to the ones I've seen him use so many times. These two are good. Well done, blowers. Dave stuffs the roll into his bag before standing up and nodding at the now grinning and proud looking lad. I head out the double doors back into the early morning air and start walking quickly towards Clarence, who is still strolling slowly behind the limping zombie. I notice he keeps his eyes up, sweeping round every few seconds. He looks over at us and the new girl walking with us, smiling at her as we get closer. Lani, this is Clarence. I make the introduction quietly, still trying to avoid alerting the undead that we're behind him. He's well enough ahead and still shuffling along quite happily. Hi. Are you in there? Clarence rumbles quietly. Yeah. She looks in awe at the giant man. You've been in there since it happened? We settle into a gentle walk, keeping a safe distance behind, each one of us sweeping round for a full view every few seconds. I was working in the nightclub upstairs. So is this everywhere then? Yep. I watched it on television when it started in Europe, and that fell in a few hours. We've been all over the south coast. London's gone. No government, no police or army, nothing. I kept thinking help would come, but it just went on and on. I saw those people come on the boats, and I was going to go, but I I got scared and didn't know what to do. So why confront us, then? I ask her. I don't know. I thought you were those things... She shrugs as the group listened to her speaking. I thought they were all slow in the daytime. I've already killed a few. Her voice remains strong yet quiet as she speaks. Why are we following him? She motions with the meat cleaver towards the undead trying to negotiate a high curb. His broken leg won't lift high enough and keeps dragging him back. We stop walking for a few minutes and watch with growing frustration as he makes attempt after attempt but keeps dropping back down into the road. I'll go and kick him up the arse in a minute, Blowers mutters. Tut tut, anything to touch an arse, eh, Blowers? Cookie says quickly. I'm not rising to it, Cookie. Bet you do for him, though, Cookie says, nodding towards the zombie as Nick sniggers. Yeah, oh no, Nick sighs as the zombie gets onto the curb and balances for a few seconds before toppling back down again. They're gaining. We turn as Dave looks back down the way we came at the mass of undead slowly shuffling into view past the now blazing buildings spreading along the road. Shouldn't we hide? Lani asks in a quiet voice. We need to follow that thing to find out where Darren is, Clarence replies, staring back down the road. Darren? Lani asks, clearly confused. Blower starts recounting the story from when they were at Salisbury Barracks and were found by Dave and I. Nick and Cookie join in, eagerly bragging about the exploits, journeys and battles we've had. They go quieter and more serious as they explain about how Darren got turned, how we lost McKinney and through to the final battle when we lost Tucker, Curtis and finally Jamie. Lani stays quiet throughout the whole explanation, looking to each of them in turn as they all join in with different parts. She nods and asks quick questions to clarify points and just during that short time... I can see she's an intelligent person and quick to smile as the lad's infectious humour catches onto her. At the end, she looks downcast and saddened, looking at them earnestly. 
Now I see both Nick and Cookie looking away as their eyes fill with tears and they swallow the sudden lumps in their throats. What about you? Blowers asks, giving the other two a chance to recover for a minute. She smiles sadly as we start walking again. The zombie eventually making it up the curb and continuing his painfully slow shuffle. I was working in the nightclub upstairs. I had to come down to get some change from the office in the bowling alley. It took me a few minutes to do the alarm and get into the safe. When I got back up, it was just a mess. I thought it was just a massive fight at first, but then I saw the blood and injuries, the biting and people on the floor bleeding. I ran back down and called the police, but they wouldn't answer. I kept trying and trying, but I couldn't get through. After a while, I went back up and peeked through the door, but it was even worse. I stayed downstairs after that. I could see things happening through the windows, fighting and people getting dragged onto the floor. People I knew, too. I just hid there all night and most of the next day. My phone ran out of battery because I tried calling everyone but couldn't get through. Have you been there the whole time? I ask gently. She doesn't show any emotion as she speaks and reminds me of Dave the way she keeps her face expressionless. No, I stayed for a few days, then one day I got out and went home. I don't live that far away. I kept seeing groups of those things standing about and stayed away from them. I got home, but my street was full of them. So I went to other people's houses, people I knew, but they were either turned into those things or just gone. I hid that night and then came back here the next day. When I got back, the doors had been kicked in, so I figured somebody had been in. That's why I didn't fix them. I didn't want anyone to know someone was in there. She looks at me as she explains that bit. Makes sense, I nod. That's it, really. Family? No. They were in the street when I went home. They'd been bitten or whatever. That's awful. I'm so sorry, Lani, I say gently. The others add comforting words too, but she remains as deadpan as before. Mum? Dad? She shrugs. My little brother? She nods as though explaining something entirely normal. Bloody hell, mate, I don't know what to say. I shake my head and look down at the floor. There are no words to say to someone after seeing that. Nothing really to say. Everyone has suffered. True. You've done well by the sounds of it. She smiles at me. Very well, Clarence adds with a nod at the small woman. So you've had contact then? Contact? She asks. With them. You said you'd killed a few, he explains. At my friend's flat. I knew he had a key hidden, so I let myself in, but he was already inside. He must have got bitten and got home before he turned. I stabbed him in the face. And then some more were in the corridor when I went back out. She keeps the same flat tone, either masking her emotions extremely well, or is like Dave and it simply doesn't bother her. But then she showed empathy when the lads explained about our losses, which is something Dave isn't able to do. Have you seen any other survivors? I ask. No, none, other than the people getting off the boats, but they didn't hang around. There were two older men leading them. One had a white beard. The bloke with the beard was the Navy captain. The other one was Ted. He was probably dressed like a policeman, I explain. I couldn't see clearly, but he was dressed in black and looked like he had a gun. Yeah, that was Ted. So, any ideas where they could have gone? Where does this direction lead? If you find Darren, will you kill him? She asks quickly and gets a chorus of emphatic responses from all of us. If you keep going along, there's the Esplanade and the Boating Lake. Then it goes to a long forest area until it gets to the next village, but that's a few miles away. What's in between? Dave asks. A couple of cafes, an old tower on the beach. Old tower? Dave interrupts. It's really small. You couldn't fit more than a few people inside. OK, keep going, Dave prompts her. The forest area, but that's got a big open space in the middle and it's not that big, really. Then there's Puckpool. Wait. She stops mid-stride, thinking for a second. Puckpool is an old fort, too, she adds quickly. A fort? I ask as we all stop to watch her intently. 
Yeah, it's really old, like well over 100 years or something. There's a cafe and tennis court, car park, but one side is really high. It's all overgrown now, but there's bunkers and like underground tunnels. It's worth a look. How far is it? Couple of hours walk. She stares back at me. Right, we can't risk leading Darren to it, so we have to sort him out first. Agreed? They all nod back at me, apart from Lani, who bites her bottom lip again. Or we send a scout forward, Dave says. I could go for this place, Lani said. We won't know where to meet. We could get separated or anything could happen. I think we should stick together. The thought of losing Dave is almost unbearable. I'll find you, Dave says, confident and matter of fact. I don't like the idea, mate. How about, Clarence cuts in, we go for the new place and Dave holds back to see if Darren trails us. That tower is about halfway, Lani says. It's a good meeting place. Dave? I look at the small, serious man. He nods back in agreement. I still don't like the idea, but it makes sense. We can make pace to find our group, knowing our rear is covered by the most dangerous man any of us, including Clarence, has ever known. For a second, I wonder if the pressure ever gets to him. If Dave ever suffers self-doubt or insecurity, instead of the mammoth sense of confidence he oozes from every pore in his body. You won't see me, but I'll be nearby. Dave shrugs off his rucksack and hands it to a puzzled Lani to hold. He pulls out a bottle of water and takes a long drink, downing the bottle in one long gulp. Lani, you take my bag. Mr Howie, take my shotgun. He hands the weapon over and checks his pistol and the two knives tucked into the back of his trousers. Tell me the route you're taking, he asks Lani. Uh, we'll keep to the beach, that's it really. No deviations anywhere, Dave asks. No, she replies confidently. Okay, no matter what happens, do not come back for me, Dave says firmly, then looks directly at Clarence. Do not let them come back for me. Wait at the tower for a while and make it so you are clearly seen going there. Stay visible. Wait a few hours, but if I don't come, then find shelter for the night. I'll find you. Got it. Clarence nods. Go straight to the beach and start walking. Keep the pace steady and give him time to come after you. He nods at the lads, at Clarence, and finally fixes his eyes on me. Mr Howie? He nods and is gone racing low across the road, leaping over a garden wall and dropping down the other side. No noise, no crunching footsteps, just an empty void that we all feel. Fuck me, I almost feel sorry for Darren, I mutter to break the silence. Would you want Dave coming after you? You'd lose, Clarence says quietly, staring at the point on the wall where Dave disappeared. He doesn't look much, Lani says to shocked stares from the rest of us. But then he doesn't look much. A small, quiet man, and out of all of us, he looks the least threatening. Looks are very deceiving. Let's move out. 2. See? I told you it was a good place. Marcy purrs as I look down from the window at the top of the four-storey building. She led me and my babies down the road as daylight started to hit taking us through deserted back streets until we reached the back of one of the huge houses overlooking the Esplanade and seafront. As I raced behind my raven-haired zombie beauty, I felt for the connection to my lovelies and knew they were with me. As the daylight hit, they started to slow down, but the control I have through my mind urged them to keep going, and they responded with their staggering gait. That fucking Howie and his bunch of creepy weirdos aren't the only ones that can move faster during the day. This infection, or virus, or whatever it is, keeps changing. Before the big battle, I had complete control over tens of thousands of them. I could feel them and see what they saw. I could make them dance, jump, or do whatever I wanted. But it weakened them. Pushing them too hard without food or fluids made the already dead bodies weak. And I can't afford that to happen this time. That prick Howie and his little cunt run Dave are getting more experienced every day, and so are their bum-fucking little buddies. I don't know why it changed, but it feels like I have less control now. I can urge them through my mind, but I can't see through their eyes now. I can't feel what they feel, and I don't know if I can tap into their collective experiences. 
If I'm going to be an honest super zombie, then I have to admit that maybe vanity led me astray back there. I thought because of the power I had over my babies that it would be enough, but it wasn't. I should have taken my time and accessed the millions of lessons, experiences and skills my lovelies had in their undead brains. Fuck it. Fuck Howie and his fucking bunch of fucked hards. This time I'm going to get strong and make my baby strong too. We'll use stealth and cunning instead of brute force. Talking of cunning, this Marcy is a cunning bitch and I can't work her out. She's gorgeous and everything a super zombie like me could wish for. But I don't know if she wants me or the power I have. Why can she talk and none of the others? Maybe the infection knows I need some help, so I chose her to be the one to do it. Running through the streets, I watch her bouncy backside and wish I could sink my teeth into it again. Her ass tasted amazing. Marcy led us to the back of the house and through a small car park to a single rear door. It was locked, so I made one of my babies headbutt the glass pane and reach in to unlock the door. The poor thing got the headbutt right, but struggled with the concept of unlocking it and kept trying to headbutt the lock instead. I pulled it back and reached in to do it myself, groping round until I found the key on the inside, and a key on the inside meant one thing. Breakfast. We could all smell them as soon as we stepped into the house. The gentle fragrance of shit mingled with piss and an overpowering dose of fear thrown in. Leaving one grumpy, reluctant zombie at the door, the rest of us started making our way noisily through the house. I could have made them creep quietly, but by making enough noise for the survivors to hear, it meant they got more frightened and released more pheromones of fear for us to follow. Marcy and I led them through hallways and up flights of stairs, giggling and groping each other, and I could tell the hunt made her excited as she kept walking faster and faster. At the top of the final flight of stairs, we stopped and stared down the long corridor to the door at the far end. The stench emanating from it gave away their hiding place. Marcy started walking towards the door, but I grabbed her arm and pulled her back. She spun round, grinning at me as I laughed and kept hold of her. Please, she begged. I'm so hungry. She purred close to my ear before dropping her mouth down to my neck and starting to bite my skin. Laughing, I pulled away and grabbed her wrist as she tried breaking free and running to the door. Fucking around in the hallway, I could sense the eagerness of my zombies to burst through and satisfy their craving. But none of them dared to overtake me and held back. But they did groan louder and started making some lovely growling and snarling noises. That just increased the smell of the fear coming from the room ahead of us, which in turn excited us all even more. But the pleasure is in the anticipation. And being the true tyrannical super zombie that I am, I made them wait until Marcy was on her knees, begging me to let them go. Say pretty please, I smiled down at her frowning face. Pretty please, she blinked her red bloodshot eyes up at me. Say pretty please, oh great zombie army leader. Oh pretty please, oh great and wonderful amazing leader of all the zombies. That's not what I said. Oh come on please, she looked up at me pleadingly. I'll make it worth your while. She smiled and started rubbing her hand on my undead groin. I stayed silent for another minute or two, just so she knew who was in charge and who the boss was. But in the end, the craving was threatening to overwhelm me too, so I pulled her up, turned around so she was facing the door, and squeezed her behind. Kill them all. I whispered in her ear and she was off. The sight got me going, got us all going, and as a pack, we charged down the hall and ploughed into the door. It was locked from within, but the combined weight of us all throwing our bodies at it soon made it crash open. And there they were, six scared little survivors, a whole family by the looks of it, old ones, middle-aged ones, and some young ones too. Marcy was wonderful, leaping into them with a frenzied snarl, she lashed out and sunk her teeth into one of the middle-aged people, who stupidly stood up to try and protect the little ones. While Marcy dealt with them, I dropped down on all fours and stalked slowly towards the children, snarling and laughing. My babies were soon stuck in, chomping away amidst screams of pain and terror, munching and slurping as blood sprayed out, soaking all of us. 
I made them take it easy on most of the bodies and just do enough to turn them. They abided my instruction, but I could sense the growing hunger in them, so I let them have the little ones to eat fully. We all did, sinking down to tear flesh open with our bare teeth and savour the hot metallic blood pumping out into our mouths. Breaking away from the feast, I made my way from body to body, taking chunks out and making sure my saliva got into their bloodstream. By the time the feasting finished, the first killed were starting to come back, twitching away with convulsions before sitting up and opening their glorious bloodshot eyes. As each one came back, I sensed a new connection being made and made sure they knew who I was. The more I did it, the easier it got, and within a few minutes, I had a bigger horde. These bodies were fresh and strong, just turned, and I could sense the power in them and the instant hunger they all had. Now, standing by the window next to Marcy, I stare down along the seafront and take in the sweeping bay of golden sands with the blue waters gently lapping away. Why are they lying down? Marcy asks as she watches our horde all lower themselves to the floor and lay flat out facing up. I think they go slower during the day to conserve energy. They don't eat or drink, and even with the infection doing whatever it does to us, I think they still wear down and get weaker if they're pushed too hard. Looking at them now, I feel a fatherly love for them, my babies all doing as they're told and resting after a nice big meal. Can you connect to all of them? She asks me quietly. Yep. I nod before turning to look back out the window. Can you feel anything with them? No, I don't think so. What does it feel like? Think of a bank of monitors all stacked up on a wall and each one giving a different view. That's what it was like before. I could see what they saw. Thousands of them at the same time, but also I could feel them too. Now the vision has gone, but the feeling is still there, like an invisible lead that runs from them to me. I could access their memories, emotions, experiences before too, but that's gone now. It's difficult to explain, but I can just feel them. Like a telepathic connection? Yeah, I guess so. Whatever this thing is inside of us, it keeps changing, evolving and trying new things. It gave me so much power before, but I fucked up, and it feels like I'm almost being punished by having less power now. If I could tap into all the zombies and see what they saw, then we'd find Howie's little piggies and fucking destroy them. He's such a cunt, that Howie. You should meet him. He's so fucking righteous and decent, it makes you want to puke. And the way all those little twats all look up to him. I mean, who the fuck is he? Just some fucking supermarket manager. What right has he got to go slaughtering them all? This isn't some virus that's going to die out. We're a new species, and we've got as much right as them to be here. I do want to meet him, she says wistfully. Why? Why do you want to meet him? Do you fancy him or something? Fuck me, you're always talking about him, going on about how he this and how he that, you fucking dirty little slag. I want what you want, Darren. I want to hurt and destroy him for what he's done to you. I want to make him our slave, all of them our slaves, and everyone we turn will worship you until we've got an army. We can sweep through this land and claim it as ours. Fuck me, you're ambitious. For you, dear. Just for you. You're local. Where would they go? Somewhere big enough to hold a few hundred of them. Somewhere safe they can defend with food and water. She stares out of the window thoughtfully. There's a place a few miles down the beach, an old mortar battery. It's got a big cafe in the grounds and high walls on one side. That's the closest place that I can think of, unless they went inland. No, they'd stay somewhere close so that prick Howie can find his little piggy babies and take them back so they can lick his feet and tell him how wonderful he is. Fucking twat. That's the first place to try, then. But if they've got a few hundred people plus Howie and his men... She pauses, looking at me. What? I shrug at her. We'll go and fuck them up. Darren, my sweetheart, you're so brave and strong, she nuzzles up to me. But if they've got so many and we've only got a few, then we'll get more, I say firmly. We'll go house to house and find survivors and build a bigger, stronger army. 
Oh, you're so clever and powerful. I wish I could think like you. Can we do it today? What about hiding? We've got a brilliant view and we'll see if any of them fucktards go past. Oh, Darren, but you're connected to all our babies. They can rest and keep watch. I know. We'll leave some here to watch and if they see Howie or his little dick friends, I'll sense it. We can post sentries as we go. Oh, baby, it turns me on when you say such smart things. Her hand drops to my groin and starts rubbing again. Or we could just stay here and be the first zombies to fuck, I say as she rubs away. I want that, Darren. I want that more than anything. But you're right. We should focus on getting more bodies today. Then we'll be safer and we can have all the time together we want. She breaks away reluctantly and I can see the longing in her eyes. But I'm right. We've got work to do. Time for playing later. Leaving one of my babies at the windows front and back, I gather the rest and start leading them back down through the house. As we get to the back door, Marcy asks me to stop and darts off into the kitchen. Coming back with two big knives, she hands one to me and tucks the other in the waistband of her tight black skirt. I don't need a fucking knife, I'm a super zombie for fuck's sake. What kind of message does that send if I have to start carrying weapons? I say with disgust. It shows that you're clever and smart. It shows that you can use tools and think like normal. It separates us from them. She nods at the gathered, drooling zombies, all staring at me with love and awe. Fuck it, I shrug, and tuck the knife into my own waistband. If it makes you happy. You make me happy, she smiles brilliantly and flutters her dark eyelashes at me. She is hot for a dead chick. Outside, I start leading my little horde over to the next house, but Marcy says we should go away from the seafront and start a few streets back so we can avoid Howie. I tell her I'm not scared and if we see them, we can fucking eat them, but she flutters those eyelashes and pouts that pretty mouth. And for the sake of pleasing her, I change my mind and decide we should start further in the town away from the esplanade. Tactically speaking, I am right. We shouldn't be near the front with so few in our group. I'm glad I had the foresight to think of moving away. Marcy leads the way, cutting through the small streets and twisting lanes of this old town until we're absorbed in the middle of the residential area and passing huge old houses with big expensive cars burnt out on the road. We move into one wide avenue and see a small gathering of our brethren shuffling around outside a house. There must be survivors inside, I remark as we stride towards them. Can you connect to them? Marcy asks, pointing at the undead, turning to watch us approach. I focus hard, but the only ones I feel are the zombies round me, the ones I've already bitten. No, just ours. Try biting one of them, see if that makes a difference, she urges me as we draw closer. Fuck off, you bite one of them, they're fucking filthy. I might catch a disease or something. Silly, she laughs at me. They're infected. They won't have any diseases. How do you know? We stop nearby and watch as the new horde shuffle towards us. They might not be connected, but they still recognise a super zombie when they see one. Just try one, she urges. No fucking way, I shake my head. Their beautiful, gorgeous lovelies all gnarled up from long days in the sun. Dried skin with sunken cheeks and a lovely, pale, deathly pallor. But they look fucking gross with flies buzzing around them. Darren, just try it. She pulls one forward who stares at her with a look of submissive awe. She sees my reluctance and draws her knife. Placing the sharpened edge on its bare arm, she pulls the blade back, slicing the flesh open and licking her lips as blood starts oozing out. It's different. She feels the blood between her fingers, rubbing it between her tips and sniffing it. Thicker, and he doesn't bleed as much as a normal person would. We heal faster and our blood congeals quicker. That's why they go for either the head or a main artery so we bleed out. Don't lick it, Marcy, you don't know where he's been. Oh, it tastes nice. She licks at the blood on her fingers, smiling at me. Try it. I'm not a cannibal, Marcy. We don't eat our own. We'll spit in his cut then. See if that does it. 
Oh, fucking hell, come here then. I pull his arm out and pull a big gob of spit in my mouth before letting it drool out into his freshly torn skin. As it lands, Marcy rubs it in, making sure the saliva gets rubbed down and into his bloodstream. Anything? She asks me. Nope. I try and focus, but nothing happens. No new connections or anything. Maybe you need your blood in him. Oh, well, I'll just chop a fucking finger off, shall I, and feed it to him? No, baby, I like your fingers, she purrs. Just make a little nick in your fingertip and drip your blood in his cut. Shaking my head, I do as she suggests, using the knife to prick the end of one finger and letting the thick drops fall into the wound. Marcy rubs it in while I close my eyes and search for any new incoming connections. Nothing happens. I smile at her. She looks disappointed for a few seconds before smiling back at me. Oh well, we'll just have to do it the old-fashioned way, my darling. She shoves her way through the horde until she reaches the front door. Trying the handle, she finds it locked, but steps back to find a nice big rock to use and sends it through the glass pane. She reaches in and unlocks the door as a man comes running down the interior hallway, holding a golf club above his head and screaming loudly. Marcy just stands there and waits for him to swing out. I start forward thinking she'll be hurt, but she catches the golf club in mid-flight and kicks out viciously into the man's stomach. He doubles over and she drops down to rip a chunk of flesh from his neck with her teeth. Bite him, honey, she says to me with blood dripping down her chin. The man squirms and fights, lashing out with fists as I advance on him. He clutches his neck and screams in anger and fear, crabbing backwards down the hallway and shouting, Run! to whoever else is in the house. Doors open and I hear footsteps and terrified screams. Marcy is ahead of me listening with her head cocked on one side and I notice none of the horde try and push past her either. The sense of excitement overtakes me, so I swoop down and grab his ankle, lifting it up high and taking a nice big chunk out of his fat calf. He screams as I drop it, and I leave him there, pissing himself in fear while I charge up the stairs behind Marcy. A woman launches herself at us from one of the upstairs rooms, swinging a big kitchen knife, but Marcy deftly sidesteps and sticks her own blade deep into the woman's stomach, laughing as she falters, trips and goes headfirst down the stairs. We'll get her in a minute. Now, what else do we have? Oh my, oh my, oh my. She stops in the doorway, staring in. Joining her, I look into the room and see a teenage male standing in the middle of the room, holding a baseball bat as though ready to strike. He's a big lad, all pumped up muscles and spotty skin. Clear signs of steroid abuse, but he does have massively thick arms. Hello, big boy, she purrs and slinks a step further into the room. You're a big boy, aren't you? Come near me and I'll fuck you up, the boy answers in a surprisingly deep voice. I lean against the doorframe and watch with interest. I'm sure you will, big boy. Fuck me up, that is. Marcy draws the words out seductively. I just stabbed your mummy in her stomach. Couldn't give a fuck. She's not my mother, the boy answers. Oh, stepmummy is she? Wow, fancy a big boy like you living at home with a hot stepmum like that. Did you get on well? Despite the incredible circumstances, the boy's face glows red with embarrassment as Marcy claps her hands with glee. Oh, you naughty boy, naughty, naughty, she laughs at him. Did daddy know? Fuck off, the boy growls, making Marcy laugh even more. I'm not laughing at you, big boy. I can see why she was attracted to you with those big muscles. Strangely, I don't feel the slightest bit jealous, which surprises me. New age, new rules, I guess. Did she slip in while Daddy was at the golf club, did she? Marcy steps closer, keeping her hands tucked behind her back and taking small steps. She lowers her head so she can look up at him, fluttering her eyelids and swinging her gorgeous hips. He tenses up as though ready to swing, but I can see his eyes are fixed on her. Oh, Darren, he's so lovely. She turns to smile at me and I laugh with the absurdity of it. Can I keep him? Please let me keep him. 
She giggles and turns back to see him standing there looking confused. Tell me, big boy, is it true what they say about steroids? She slinks closer and closer to him until he could easily swing out and strike her, but he holds his pose and just watches Marcy with keen interest. She smiles at him and steps closer until she's just inches from his towering frame. Is it true? She says quietly and places one hand on the groin of his tracksuit bottoms. She rubs then grips hard. Oh, it's not true. They don't shrink. The boy grimaces with a mixed look of pleasure and confusion, still holding the bat up high. Now listen, big boy, I'm going to bite you. She keeps rubbing his groin while she whispers in his ear. It will only hurt a little bit, and after that, you'll be mine. Amazingly, he lowers the bat and stands there with his eyes half closed. She stretches up and starts nuzzling his neck, gradually applying more pressure as her hand kneads away. Suddenly, she bites down and sucks in his blood, tearing a small chunk of flesh away. He jumps backwards and clutches his neck with a shocked look on his face, staring at her, then at me. I step into the room and walk slowly towards him. He backs away in fear, knocking into a desk and sending papers and mugs onto the floor. Take it easy. Just let it happen. I speak softly and remember how I felt when they took me down in London. Come on now, be a big brave soldier for me. Marcy slides over to him and starts stroking his face as his legs buckle. He falls to the floor and stares up with a look of terror, and despite his size, he looks young and frightened. Marcy drops down and keeps stroking his face as his breathing becomes shallower. His eyes close and we watch with interest as he gently dies right in front of us. Quick, Marcy urges me and I hunker down to suck at the wound on his neck, making sure his blood and my saliva get mixed together. Drawing back, we both watch intently for a few minutes until he starts convulsing, twitching, and his eyes spring open to stare out with that magical bloodshot appearance. Welcome back, big boy. Marcy purrs, and for a second I think he's about to answer, but his jaw goes slack and he groans instead. The connection is there instantly in my mind, and I can feel the devotion he has not just for me, but for Marcy too. Two more are taken from this house and we move on, going from door to door, turning those inside and gradually increasing the size of our loyal horde. With each one turned, I feel the connection instantly as they open their eyes and come back from the dead. Our pace increases as we move down the streets, feasting, killing and murdering without mercy. The hunger inside all of us never gets satisfied, but with each fresh kill I feel a strengthening of mind and body. How we can get fucked now, I boast to Marcy as we turn the corner into the new tree-lined street with a massive following of slack-jawed, drooling lovelies staggering behind us. Yes, my love, but not yet. We need more before we go after him, she replies in a gentle tone. Look at those big houses with their big fucking expensive cars. What good did it do them? The greedy fucking cunts with their greedy middle class jobs hiding away like pussies in their own filth and hoping someone comes to rescue them. I've got an idea, Marcy suddenly giggles. Wait here and keep them back for a minute. I make the horde slink into the side of the pavement and crouch down underneath a row of long bushes. They look fucking ridiculous all bending over in a long line. Marcy spits on her hands and wipes the blood away from her face, then smiles at me before sneaking forward along the garden fence of the nearest house. I peer over and watch as she goes through the gate and gets halfway to the front door before she lets out a piercing scream and starts shouting for help while she falls down to the ground clutching her leg. Within minutes, I can see curtains twitching and faces looking down at the beautiful woman writhing in agony on the ground. Help! I've broken my ankle! Please help! She screams, looking about frantically. The front door opens and two men burst out, racing to her aid. Are you bitten? One of them asks before they get too close. No, I was hiding in a house down the road, but I ran out of food. I panicked and started running and twisted my ankle. I think it's broken, 
she groans, but keeps her eyes narrowed and her hair covering her face so they don't see her eyes. I think back to the little shop on the mainland when I pretended to be a survivor. Smiling, I can't help but start playing too. Marcy, I call out in a strained voice. Where are you? Who's that? One of the men asks quickly. It's my husband. I'm here, love. I've hurt my ankle, she cries out. I run up the road pretending to be looking for her. When I see her in the driveway of the house, I race in, keeping my face down, and stoop down when I get to her, examining her leg. Oh, baby, are you okay? I ask with pretend concern, trying not to laugh. I think it's broken, she wails. These nice men were about to help me. Can you help me carry her? I call out, still keeping my head down. Yeah, but quick, get her in quick before we attract attention. They come forward and bend down to start trying to lift her. One of them shoves his arm under her legs, brushing her backside inadvertently. Did you just touch my wife's ass, mate? I yell at him and he recoils in alarm. Don't touch my wife's ass. Why are you a fucking pervert? We come here asking for help and you start trying to touch her up, you fucking cunt. I, I, I didn't, he stammers. He touched my tits before you got here. They both did, Marcy shouts. You touched my wife's tits? I explode in anger. What the fuck? They both stare at each other in alarm as I start laughing and hold my hand out. I'm sorry. I'm only joking, mate. Sorry, I didn't mean it, but you should have seen your face. Oh, it was priceless. What the fuck? He repeats. You're fucking nuts, mate. Talking of faces, have you seen mine? I stop laughing and look up at them both, showing them my red eyes and blood-encrusted face. The blood visibly drains from their faces as they start inching backwards before coming to their senses and turning to run. It's too late, though, as Marcy and I lunge at them, howling with murderous laughter. We take one each, dragging them to the ground and tearing flesh open while the house inside erupts in screams. My horde reacts quickly, pouring through the gate and entering the house with howls and snarls. Sitting back on my haunches with my eyes closed, I feel my zombies as they move from room to room, finding more survivors and tearing them open. I let them have their fun, but not too much and I make sure none of the bodies are too badly mangled. Fucking wonderful. This is the most fun I have ever had. Marcy and I are both laughing as we stroll through the house together so I can get my saliva into the fresh corpses before they come back. As the day draws on, the heat from the blistering sun grows hotter and our horde grows larger with every pathetic bunch of survivors we find. And with every new kill... I dream of finding Howie's little piggy cunts and fucking them up. 3. I still haven't seen him. Nick turns slowly round, scanning the area as we walk along the concrete path at the top of the beach. The golden sands roll gently downhill to the blue waters of the sea and the lack of humanity trudging up and down with their dogs and children have left the sands unmarked and virginal. Sand blown from the beach coats the road and pathway, and I guess the council would normally have maintenance vehicles out every day, sucking the sand up to deposit back on the beach. Already within this short space of time, the world is forgetting that humans once lived here, and nature starts its gradual reclamation of what was our world. You won't see him, I reply, knowing Dave and the incredible skills he has, I would be amazed if he let any of us see him. That's him up there, disguised as that lamppost. No, he was behind us in that litter bin, Blowers adds. I think he's kidnapped Lani without us seeing and has disguised himself as her, Cookie says, looking suspiciously at Lani. All right, Dave, he adds with a nod. Lani smiles, and like Dave, it lights her whole face up. I'm still bloody hungry, Nick grumbles after a few seconds of silence. There's a cafe further up there, Lani says. I wonder if they're open, Nick says. Might be, Cookie replies. They've got a daily special of brains on toast. They used to get loads of kids down here at night getting drunk and smashing things up, Lani explains. The cafe put metal shutters on the doors and windows so it might be okay. 
They had a gang of kids down here. I'm surprised that somewhere as nice as this would have those kind of problems. It was awful in the summer, Lani says. Every kid on the island would come over here. I used to go down here too, she shrugs. Nothing else to do, really. What about the beach? Clarence asks. What about it? Lani replies. There's loads to do on the beach and you've got lots of open spaces, countryside and forests. So? I grew up on a housing estate in London. I would have killed to live somewhere like this. It's pretty, but boring, she says. Are you from here? Blowers cuts in. Thailand. My family came here when I was very young, so I grew up here. I love Thai food, Nick says, clearly still thinking of his stomach. There was a Thai restaurant where I lived. Is that the cafe? I ask, seeing a squat brick-built building a few hundred metres ahead. As we get closer, I see the shiny metallic shutters on the doors and windows, just as Lani said. Cafe is set on a grass bank and surrounded by rows of old-style beach huts and flower beds sloping down to the sandy beach. In the contrasting tranquil beauty of the area, the shutters look ugly and urban, a sign that all was not well in the life we thought was civil and ordered. The tower's just there. Lani points further up the beach to a Disney-looking structure, a small single castle tower looking distinctly out of place. Right, I'm bloody famished. We'll get in that cafe and get some proper food. Cookie and blowers, go round the back and see if you can find a way in. Nick, you watch the way we came from. Clarence, you okay watching ahead? Yes, boss, Clarence replies, striding a few steps forward to get a good view. Cookie and blowers quickly peel off as Nick walks back a few steps and turns to watch the route we just took, leaving Lani and I standing together. So, you were in the army then? Lani asks after a few seconds. Me? No, I was a night manager in a supermarket. I worked with Dave. He was in the army a few years ago. Clarence too. Oh, I thought you were. You look like you're in the army. Do I? I laugh quietly. I guess that's better than looking like a supermarket manager. But you're in charge of them all? She asks with a serious look. Well, kind of. I guess that just sort of happened on its own. It's weird, really, how it came about. I was desperate to get to London to find my sister and things kept happening that slowed me down. So I just kind of took over so I could do what I needed to get done, if that makes any sense at all. I shake my head, smiling wryly at the memories of the last nine days. Your sister? She's with the group that came here? Yeah, they've got some good people with them, so they should be okay. Mr Howie, the rear doors are shuttered too. We'll need a vehicle or something to pull them off, Blowers calls out as he and Cookie appear from the side of the building. Nick, can you hotwire a car, mate? I call out. Older ones are easier than new ones, Mr Howie. I've never done one, but it can't be that hard. Nick is brilliant with electrical things, I say to Lani. He hotwired Tower Bridge in London a few days ago. We just need a car now, Blowers says, joining us with Cookie. There's a car park up there. Lani points up the hill behind the cafe. Is it open land, or are there places for those things to hide? I ask her. It's all open, literally like a two-minute walk. I'll go with Nick if you want and show him. Take blowers with you. Cookie, you go a bit further up and keep a line of sight with them and us. I'll take Nick's position. They move off as I take over, watching the rear while Clarence stands solidly watching ahead and scanning round every few seconds. The beach is on my right, with the pavement and then the road ahead of me. On the left is a high, old, stone-built wall with huge tree branches hanging low. Dave must be behind that wall somewhere. He could be there now, watching me. I give a little wave in case he is watching, then, feeling stupid, I stick one finger up and smile to myself, hoping he's not offended. But then I don't think it is even possible to offend Dave, apart from that time I broke his shotgun in Portsmouth. I wonder how Chris is getting on, if he's got our fort back up and running yet. It's funny, but already I'm thinking of it as sort of home, the place where we need to get back to. There's no rules now. No society that demands we act or behave in a certain way. Any one of these lads or Clarence could just say fuck it and walk off to live how they want. But we all know that we're stronger together and there is an incredible bond between us already.
Lani's words replay in my head that I'm the one in charge. I don't mean to boss them about, but it just feels natural now. And even with Clarence and Dave, I can feel them waiting and watching for the decisions that come from me. Even when I defer to their skills and experiences, it's just a given that it will be me making the final decision. People are strange. The need to have that pecking order, even when the world is ending. There could be hundreds or thousands of groups like ours with normal, everyday people that had mundane jobs suddenly thrust forward and taking leadership. The sounds of smashing glass, followed by vehicle alarms, rings out for a few seconds, and I imagine Nick quickly releasing the bonnet clasps to detach the battery wires. The sounds cut off as expected, and are followed a few minutes later by an engine roaring to life. I listen as the sound draws closer until an old red van comes into view, bouncing over the grass and slewing round the side of the cafe with a grinning Nick at the wheel and Lani sitting next to him, laughing. Blowers and Cookie come jogging behind it, with Blowers yelling abuse at Nick for making them both run. The van comes to a halt and Nick gets out, laughing and pointing at Blowers. Lani clambers down, holding a thick tow rope coiled over one shoulder. The lads piss about as they hook one end onto the shutters and fasten the other end to the van. Between them, they work quickly and in good humour, and I watch Lani joining in, laughing and joking with them. With a gesture from Blowers, she jogs forward and climbs into the driver's seat, and again I wonder at the pecking order of human life. Even amongst those few young people, Blowers assumes the role of leader and directs the others. They laugh and joke, but even so... They do as instructed, and without question. Now, Lani! Blowers shouts. The van surges forward with Lani at the wheel. The rope goes instantly taut and rips the shutters from the frame with a loud wrenching noise, followed by a metallic clang as it bounces on the concrete ground. Nick and Cookie get to the door together and start synchronised kicks until the thick wooden door bursts open. They all cheer at the small victory, and I watch with interest as they all instinctively turn to look at me, waiting for my response and the next instruction. Brilliant. Well done. Me and Clarence will stay here while you get some food. Lani, make sure they don't eat anything poisonous. She laughs and nods as they disappear into the cafe. Looking up, I see Clarence smiling at me with a huge grin, and I stroll over to him, making sure I've got a good view of the surrounding area. She seems nice. I remarked to the big man. He nods back. Been through it by what she says, he replies. I worry though, mate. We've got this far thanks to Dave and you, but what if something happens and we lose him or lose you? You'll survive as long as you stay together. Yeah, maybe, but we need to increase our chances. Mate, maybe you and Dave could give us some training or something. Not just in guns, but with other weapons like knives or something. I've seen you fight, Clarence grins. I've watched all of you fight. It's wild, but it's brutal and it works. Training could confuse or restrain what you're doing naturally. Okay, just a thought. What are they doing? Looking over, I watch Nick and Cookie dragging a large wooden table down onto the middle of the path, followed by blowers carrying handfuls of drinks and food. Nick and Cookie go back inside and come out within seconds carrying more grub until the table is laden with packets, bags and bottles of water and juice. Lani appears carrying a big bowl of fruit. Fruit, Clarence smiles and starts walking towards her. Any bananas, he calls out. They're mouldy and black, Lani replies, but there's some apples and oranges here. Dave said to wait at the tower, but I guess this is close enough. Just make sure we keep a good watch. I sit down at the table and select a big green apple, looking at it closely before I sink my teeth into it and feel the fresh juice burst into my mouth. Oh, that's so good. There's a barbecue inside with a gas bottle. I've got it going to make hot water for coffee. Nick comes out smiling and rubbing his hands together. A few minutes later, I'm watching as the lads devour everything in front of them while Lani eats politely. I can see she's hungry, but she restrains herself from going mad, unlike the rest of us who go at it like crazy. Sitting in the beautiful warm sunlight, we could almost forget why we're here and what we're here for. The food gets eaten, 
and Nick goes back into the cafe with Lani before reappearing a few minutes later with a tray of plain white coffee mugs all steaming away. Milk portions, Cookie exclaims, delighted at the sight of the individual long-life milk sachets. He rips the top off one and drinks it down quickly. Oh, look at this, Blowers groans with pleasure. Coffee, sugar and milk. Like I said, small victories make for the best feelings sometimes, and for this short amount of time while the world crumbles around us, and with a town full of cannibal zombies ready to rip our hearts out, we sit in the sun drinking coffee. Nick breaks out a packet of cigarettes and hands them round. Blowers, Cookie and Lani take one each and are soon sitting there in a state of bliss. The temptation is too much, so I slide one out of the packet and light it up, inhaling deeply. I hold the smoke in my lungs for a second before blowing it out gently and immediately doubling over with a coughing fit. Shit! I haven't had one for ages! I wipe the tears from my eyes and take another drag as the others laugh at my sorry state. You shouldn't smoke, Mr. Howie. Dave's voice surprises us all, making us jump and start going for weapons laying within grabbing reach. He's leaning against the corner of the cafe, watching us benignly. How long have you been there? I splutter. Only a second or two. He walks over and sits down next to Clarence. Taking a bottle of water, he screws the top off before downing it in one. I'll get you a coffee, Dave. Nick gets up, heading towards the cafe. Is there herbal tea? Dave asks into a sudden silence as we all take in what he just asked for. Herbal tea? Nick asks. Chamomile or peppermint? Dave says, taking an apple from the nearly empty bowl. He pulls a small knife from his pocket and starts cutting chunks off. Right, yeah, I'll uh, have a look, Nick says. Dave puts the chunk of apple in his mouth before looking up and seeing us all staring at him. I like herbal tea, he shrugs and cuts another chunk of apple. Fair enough, mate. Did you see anything? I ask him. Nothing, he shakes his head and looks at me. Something isn't right. I can feel it. There's no movement. Nothing was following you. Nothing, he adds. That's a good thing, right? Cookie asks. Should be, Dave replies but it isn't. Why not? Blowers cuts in. It means Darren has found something else to do, Clarence says. Something more important than coming after us. I see, I reply. What could that be? If I was him, I'd be trying to build resources again, getting more of those things before he comes at us. Maybe we should go after him now, then, Blowers says with a hard look. Take the fight to him for a change. Cookie nods seriously. Lani glances at them both before looking back to me. I agree, Nick adds, placing a mug down in front of Dave. We've got a guide now, Clarence nods at Lani. Options, I lean forward. We're here to get our group and get back to our fort. Darren poses a risk and will kill them and us at the first chance he gets. He could be trying to get more zombies to come after us, which means we either take him out now, but by doing that we put ourselves at risk, or we keep going and hope we can find them before he does. By which time he could have turned loads of them and be an even bigger risk. We don't have the firepower or the resources to fight back like we did last time, Dave replies flatly. And we'll be lucky to find them and get back to the boats before nightfall. And even then we've got to hope the tide isn't out. Last night was hard enough. These shotguns are good, but they take too long to reload. I take another drag of the cigarette. If we knew they'd stay slow, we'd stand a good chance of getting them now, Blowers says. But we know they can turn like that. He clicks his fingers for effect. Pity there's not an army base we can raid again, I mutter. There is, Lani says quickly. There's a territorial army camp, but it's on the other side of the island. How far is that? Dave asks. Driving? Maybe an hour there and an hour back. Do you know where it is? I look at her closely. I know the area it's in. I went there once with my school years ago. Did they have weapons? Dave questions her. What did you see? They had army guns. She stares off, clearly trying to think. Like you see the soldiers with on TV? 
Were they live firing? Dave asks. What's that? She replies. Could they shoot bullets? Clarence takes over. Did you see them being fired? Were there any targets up like on a range or anything like that? Oh, yeah, we watched the soldiers shooting targets. They were lying down and firing down this long field with a big hill at the end. We had to wear things on our ears because of the noise. Lani, when the guns were fired, did you see the bullet cases being ejected from the side of the weapon? Clarence asks with serious intent, but keeping his tone steady. Yeah, loads of them, like in the movies, she nods. Right, What are the chances that someone hasn't got there before us? I ask. If they take school groups there, then everyone on this island will know. Plus, all the soldiers stationed here. Shit, good point. Clarence looks over at me. If I was local, it would be the first place I would head for. We don't have the time to risk getting over there and finding it either looted or more likely defended, and they might not take kindly to a bunch of armed men knocking on their gates. We stick to the plan. Find our people and get out of here. Nods all round. Although I get what they're saying, and going after Darren is a tempting idea. We fill our bags with water and whatever snack food we can fit in before shrugging the packs on and setting off again. The thought that Darren must be massing again drives us on and our pace increases until we're all sweating heavily in the blistering heat apart from Dave and Lani, who both remain looking cool and collected. Following the shoreline, we walk round the long, sweeping bay on the picturesque path, separating the sand from the wooded area. Birds sing happily. Insects and bees buzz about merrily doing whatever insects and bees do. They know nothing of this infection that's wiped out one species already. But then I remember the rats that attacked us at the motorway service station. They were clearly infected, so why not all species? Why just us and rats? Surely an infection or disease can't just choose who it infects. But then there is a strong relationship between humans and rats. Rats will eat anything, so if they chomped on the rotten corpses and got infected, what's to stop something else eating the rats? What eats rats? I ask out loud. Cats, Lani answers quickly. Birds, foxes, dogs, anything that's hungry enough, Clarence replies. The rats at the service station, Dave asks, guessing my thought process. Yeah, just wondering what else could get infected. Everything, I guess, Nick cuts in. We might get zombie spiders, Cookie shudders as Blowers bursts out laughing. You fucking twat, zombie spiders, he sputters. Why not, Cookie retorts. They could get infected if they ate something that was infected. What do spiders eat then? Blowers goads him. Flies. And flies will lay eggs on anything, especially warm, rotting corpses, Cookie says. Well, when you put it like that, Blowers stops laughing and stares round suspiciously at the ground, as though expecting a horde of zombie spiders to suddenly launch themselves at us. So do you think this is man-made or what? What, the disease or whatever it is, Nick says. Is it a disease or virus or infection or or what? I don't know, mate, I shrug. Isn't it that a virus causes an infection, like the virus goes from person to person and they become infected as a result? So it's both, Lani asks. Maybe. Isn't a disease something that develops and doesn't need a virus? Cookie replies. Blowers, what did your doctor say at the STD clinic? He said I caught syphilis from your mum, Blowers quips, followed instantly by hoots of laughter from Nick and Lani. Even Clarence chuckles deeply. Leave my mum out of this, Cookie says in good humour. That's what the Navy said that day, Blowers quips again. You'd know what the Navy said, Cookie retorts. But you spent a load of time with sailors. Ah, good comeback, mate, Blowers nods with respect. I thank you. Cookie smiles, taking a small bow. I think it is probably man-made, I cut in. Probably some bloody scientists pissing about with things they should have left alone. More like terrorists? Nick asks. I don't know, mate, I sigh. To be honest, I wasn't sure where I stood on the whole terrorism thing. What do you mean? Clarence asks. 
Well, I'm sure we faced a threat from people who didn't like us, meaning the West, but I just think governments can get away with murder by playing the terrorist card. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of bloody crazy people in the world who want to kill anyone that doesn't believe in the same things as them, so I guess we had to take some action, but I don't know. It just felt it was more about oil than anything else. I realise I've just voiced an extreme view to two people who have probably devoted their lives to fighting and killing in the name of our country. Dave stays quiet and blank-faced as ever, but Clarence looks thoughtful. What about an antidote or cure? There has to be something that can fix it. Cookie continues his questions with a keen, interested look. It works so quickly, though, mate. We've all seen how fast it can take over the body, how it can evolve and change. If it was just how it started out, it would be easy in theory to go out and kill them in the day and hide at night. But it changed and became different. It evolved to survive, and that's just here with this threat. Imagine how else it could have changed in other places to survive other threats. We don't know how long Darren was infected before he finally turned, or why he was chosen. But we know he can speak, think, and do all the things we can do. So an antidote might work on one strain, but not work on another, is that what you're saying? Lani asks. I don't know, I shrug, feeling helpless and unable to voice the nagging fear within my mind that there will not be a cure for this. There won't be any men in white lab coats pissing about with test tubes and monkeys. This is what the world is now. Two species fighting to survive. Keep it simple and one step at a time. We find the others and get back to the fort, then worry about everything else later. Amen, Clarence rumbles. How much further? I ask Liney. Not far. Round the next bend and just a bit further on. Even she's starting to sweat now with the high heat and the sun glaring off the hot sand. The humidity feels high too and far hotter than any English summer I can remember. Rather than slowing down to take our packs off, we dip into each other's bags and take bottles of water out, rehydrating from the constant sweating and anticipation of not knowing if something will happen round the next corner. Dave turns as we march along and walks backwards, lifting his hand to shield his eyes and scan the route behind us. Anything? No, Mr Howie, nothing. He scans for a few more seconds and then about turns to carry on. Up there, Lani points off to a high wall butting up against the sea and what looks like a path snaking behind it into the tree line. The path either goes down onto the beach or round through the grounds of the park. Park? Dave asks with concern. That's what it is now, she replies. A park with mini golf, tennis courts and a cafe. You said it was a fort, Dave states with his usual diplomacy. It was a fort or something, maybe a battery. I heard it being called that too. A mortar battery, Dave replies. Yeah, that. Well, we'll see in a minute. Reaching the end of the path we're on, I can see a steep flight of stairs going down onto the beach and the high wall ahead of us. It looks solid and built in the same thick stone I saw in Fort Spitbank. That's got to be five or six metres high, I say as we draw closer. Should slow them down a little. To the right, I see a path following the high wall as it disappears into the tree line. We stop to look behind us for a few minutes, each of us shielding our eyes and scanning every inch of the vista before us. The path has risen gradually as we've come along, so we can see right along the sweeping bay, back further than the cafe we stopped at. Nothing moves in my field of vision, and none of the others pass remark at anything. With a final look round, we head into the darkened copse following the high wall and instantly feeling the slightly cooler shaded air. The path ends at a right angle going off to the left, and we see the high wall running into a steep grass bank. Turning the corner, the dirt path gives way to concrete, with the high bank running along on our left and a dilapidated fence on the other side. The bank creates a funnel which would be a perfect spot to erect a barricade and prevent entry, but my heart starts to sink at the lack of any signs of fortification in this place. 
In silence, we move forward, hands gripping our weapons and looking all around as we come out of the funnel. The high bank ends suddenly and the area in front of us opens out into a wide, modern car park. We step out into the light and see no signs of life, no fortifications, no barricades or armed sentries waiting to challenge us. On the left, there are high concrete walls with multiple thick rusted metal doors embedded in them at ground level. The undulation of the walls and the mounds clearly indicate a bunker complex from the Second World War long left to fall into ruin. At the top of the concrete wall, we see metal fencing and wooden benches set at intervals. Metal staircases fixed to the walls lead to the top, and we see more doors and barred gates as we slowly make our way into the park. The ground on the right opens out into a large, flat, grassy area with signs to inquire at the cafe for pitch and putt golf. A small brick-built kiosk stands at the edge of a children's play area, now looking ominous and somewhat sinister in the silence of the gorgeous summer day with slides, monkey bars and swings all static and unused for several days. The construct and layout is eerily similar to that of Fort Spitbank. The same conventional doorways with the same grey-coloured concrete. This must have originally been a Palmerston Fort too, and then adapted over the years for use in the World Wars. With the bunker rooms, high walls and funnel entrance, I'm amazed that it hasn't been taken over and fortified. Spread out in a line, look for any signs they pass through here. I give the instruction quietly and feel a creeping sense of unease. I expected to find our group here and I can't understand why this hasn't been put to use. The group spread out into a thin line with each person walking slowly, checking the ground, looking left and right and turning to scan behind them as they go along. Reaching the kiosk, I see another smaller car park built into the left side where the building line drops back. Up ahead is a long, low, single-storey building with big plate glass windows and the word cafe painted in thick black letters on the roof tiles. There are small brick-built buildings standing isolated in the grounds. They look solid and well-built, but have clearly been boarded up for long years with high weeds growing round the outside. Immediately behind the kiosk is the hard surface tennis court, still with the netting in place across the middle. High metal fencing runs round the perimeter, obviously to stop meandering tourists from getting whacked in the face by flying tennis balls. Fuck me! Blowers mutters at the sight of the bodies stacked up in the middle of the courts, and the many undead standing around them all slack-jawed and drooling. At the sight of us, they turn slowly and start shuffling over to the fence. I stare in horror, expecting to see members of our group, or even worse, my sister, Sarah. We all stare over at them, and I edge closer to examine each one closely. Breathing a sigh of relief, I turn and shake my head at the rest. None of ours that I can see. They nod back and walk over to the fence, staring in amazement at the sight of the dead and undead bodies. Someone's put them in there, Dave whispers. Why, though? I ask. The bodies in the middle look like dead zombies, judging by the injuries and emaciated, withered appearance. Quite a few of them are stacked up, not neatly like Dave did in the supermarket but just heaped together. At least 20 undead are still up on their feet, though, groaning as they drool and bang their faces against the metal fence. Someone just moved in the cafe, Lani whispers urgently. We spin round to face the building, but see nothing other than what looks like an empty place. Someone came to the door, saw us, and darted back in, she adds in the same hushed but rapid tone. Let's go and see. I whisper back and we set off walking down the side of the chain link fence of the tennis court. The building line comes out further from the left here with a clear addition of rooms accessed by deeply recessed doors. This forms a narrow road only wide enough for one vehicle. The road runs down to the cafe and is bordered on the right by a chest-high wooden fence which ends to show a wide grassed area in front of the cafe and I guess this is normally where the tables and chairs would be put for the summer visitors. See anything? I ask. None of them reply, but keep focused on the cafe with Dave and Clarence making constant sweeps all around us. We stop at the end of the fence and look over the grass to the cafe. The other entrance. Dave nods off to the right and I see high, ornate metal gates embedded into the high concrete wall. The gates are hinged to allow vehicles to enter the park area, 
but are now closed with a thick-looking chain wrapped round the middle struts. What's behind the cafe, Lani? Dave asks quietly. Nothing, just a back lawn and the high wall, she answers. We move slowly across the lawn, watching the front of the cafe and staring through the plate glass windows at the tables and chairs inside. The cafe doors open slightly, Dave says in muted tones as we get halfway across the lawn. Stand still and put the weapons down! A loud voice booms out behind us. We spin round with Dave and Clarence instantly, releasing their axes and having the skill and experience to drop and roll off, drawing pistols from their belts. Blowers and Cookie throw their axes to one side and reach back to pull their shotguns, both of them going into a crouch and stepping quickly to present a moving target. Nick jumps in front of Lani and starts moving away while also drawing his shotgun. A figure clad in black paramilitary clothing strides out of one of the deep recessed doors, holding a rifle. Another comes out quickly behind him. Dave, no! I bellow as fast and loud as I can, knowing Dave could drop them both instantly. Two figures stride into the road and move their rifles between us all, aiming down from balaclava-covered faces. Clad in dark overalls tucked into boots, they look like something out of a Special Forces movie. Within a split second, the two are covered by Dave and Clarence, pointing pistols at them, and the rest of us holding shotguns. They react as though surprised, and seem suddenly unsure what to do. Drop the guns! The lead black-clad figure bawls out. Drop yours, or I will kill you both! Dave's amazing voice booms out as they both turn to stare at him. Up top, Blower shouts. He holds his shotgun in one hand and draws his pistol with the other, aiming one at the figures in the road and the handgun at a third black-clad figure, leaning over the railing and pointing another rifle down at us. Stand down, Dave booms out again, and I watch as both the figures in the road twitch their rifles between the several targets in front of them. Easy, Dave, take it easy, lads, no one fires! I call out, and both figures turn to watch me. Got it, Mr Howie? Dave acknowledges, but keeps his pistol in a two-handed grip, moving swiftly between the two figures in front of him. Lads, nobody shoots. Got it? Got it, Blowers answers, but like Dave, he keeps the shotgun levelled at the people in the road and the pistol pointing up at the figure above. We're not here for trouble. I say to the two figures as they stare silently back at me. Looking closer, I can see the uniforms are unmarked, and the one that hasn't spoken is trembling. We're looking for members of our group that might have come through here. We don't want trouble and we don't want a fight. Please, just lower your weapons and we'll do the same. What's your name? The lead man asks in a gruff voice. My name is Howie. I take a slight step forward and lower my shotgun down to my side. The two figures glance at one another and visibly relax. Gradually, they lower their rifles too. So which one of you is Dave? The man pulls his balaclava off to reveal a balding head and a big grin. They said you'd be coming. Four. Fucking look at all my lovely babies. I laugh out loud and slap Marcy hard on the backside. She looks up from her kneeling position, smiling at me with fresh blood pouring down her chin. The hapless victim squirms on the ground under her iron grip and starts screaming again. I'm amazed the woman is still alive after the amount of flesh that's been ripped from her stupid fat body. We're upstairs in another house in another street. All of these houses look the same to me. Fucking beige walls with beige carpets and fucking beige sofas. Still, the colour beige really shows the blood well, and I don't think we've found a house of survivors yet and not left at least one room of bloodbath. In fact, we've got so many now that they can't all fit into the houses and are stacked up outside and grumbling at not being let in to feast. I pull the curtain back and open the window to look down into the street at the hundreds of faces all turned up to stare at me. I can't see through their eyes, but I can feel their devotion and loyalty to me. Like a superorganism now, one part made of many and me in the middle leading them all. And this lot are different. They're fresh and strong and very hungry. 
our babies, darling. Marcy sinks back down to finish the screaming bitch off. Finally, she sits back on her haunches and motions for me to take my bite. I crouch down and suck at the blood pumping out of her fat throat. No matter how much of this I've had, I still feel hungry for it. The more I had, the more I wanted, until it became frenzied and we ran from house to house, tearing throats open and killing the little cunts as they screamed and begged. A few fuckers fought back, and one even managed to kill a couple of my babies before I stepped in and threw him out of a closed window and let the rest outside tear him limb from limb. Howie can suck my zombie balls now. He can fuck off and go blow Dave in a dark corner, because while they're all reading the Bible and playing goody-goodies, I'm here putting the hard work in and trying to make sure these poor souls have got everything they need. Just imagine if I wasn't here to look after them, what would they do? They'd suffer and maybe get a few feeds in, but otherwise they'd languish outside in the heat and get all withered and dried out like prunes. Looking up at me, Marcy wipes the blood from her chin and casually looks down to examine the crimson-soaked material of her blouse. Frowning, she pulls it away from her body, but the sodden material clings to her frame. Glancing up again, she takes in the state of my own filth-encrusted clothes and shakes her head. We need clean clothes, she sighs languidly. Why? The leader of the zombie army should look the part. Smartness maketh the zombie, she adds with a smile. I don't want clean clothes. I examine the front of my own disgustingly putrid attire. We look good, I nod, smiling at her. No, Darren, we look filthy. We're getting cleaned up and after that we're going to find some clean clothes and then have a look and see if we've got enough bodies to go after your friend Howie. He's not my friend! Instant anger flushes through me. He's a fucking cunt and I'm going to get my lovelies to pin him down while I take a big zombie shit in his mouth. But we need to get cleaned up first, she says firmly. Are you connected to me? She asks quickly with a serious expression. No, I shake my head. I keep trying but I can't find you and I don't know why. Oh well, darling, I'm sure it'll come. She pats my arm and starts walking out of the room as the fresh corpse at my feet starts twitching. Well, come on then, Marcy motions with her head to follow her down the hallway to the small bathroom. Once inside, she reaches into the shower cubicle and turns the spray of water on. Fuck off if you think I'm getting in there, I recall backwards towards the door. Zombies don't wash, Marcy. Darren... We are filthy and you smell disgusting, she looks at me pointedly. No fucking way, I shake my head. Not happening, I like this smell. To prove the point, I pull my soaking top away from my body and inhale the odour of death and metallic blood deeply and smile at her. Strip, she orders. No chance. Folding my arms, I make my stand, firm and resolute. If she thinks I'm getting under that clean, fresh water, she can think again. Fine, then you can stand there and watch. She rips her blouse open, sending the little plastic buttons pinging onto the floor. She discards the top and shrugs her tight black skirt down to stand there in her black bra and panties. If you don't want to join me, that's fine. Maybe I'll go and get Big Boy up here to wash my back for me. She turns away from me and reaches round to unclasp her bra, shrugging it off and letting it fall to the floor. She bends forward and pulls the panties down and my eyes fall to the smooth curve of her ass and the crusty scab forming over the bite I gave her. My undead zombie heart starts beating faster at the sight of her naked body, all covered in patches of dried blood and filth. She steps over the bath into the powerful spray of water and lets out a loud scream. Oh, that's so cold, it hurts, she wails, turning slowly round. It hurts so much, it's so nice, she purrs. She stops turning to stand facing me with her arms down at her side, letting me take in her naked body, the mounds of her breasts and the dark nipples, her flat stomach and the gentle curve of her hips. 
Fuck this. I rip my own clothes off and jump into the water with her. She squeals with laughter as I yell out with the exquisite agony of freezing water pummeling my skin. Twenty minutes later, we're out of the shower using old towels to dry off and avoiding eye contact. Don't worry, darling. It's been a busy day. It happens to everyone, she says kindly. But I feel oddly flat. The extreme actions of the killing rampage, the utter depravity of going from house to house and the overwhelming urge to bite and kill left the act of sex feeling mundane and boring. I had a go, but after a few minutes it went soft. And to be honest, I think we both felt glad it was over. Like it was some ritual we had to go through to cement our joining of minds or the traditional beginnings of a formulaic relationship. Meet a pretty girl go out on a date, and then have sex. Times are different and we are different. The urges coursing through us are not the same anymore. Fuck it. No offence, but I'm not that bothered. What? She flares up angrily. Oh, you're lovely and all that, but that stuff we did on the street was better than trying to have proper sex. I'm still a woman, Darren, she shouts. Not really, love. I shrug. You're a dead woman, a zombie, the undead, infected and diseased along with the rest of us. She looks appalled like I just said she was fat or something. It is what it is. I walk out stark naked and stroll down the stairs and out into the bright sunlight. My babies don't show any reaction to my nakedness and I feel their devotion pour from their simple dead minds. Bare feet will cause me injury, so I make one of the zombies tug their shoes off and hand them over. Smart black business shoes with fine laces, and they fit perfectly. What the fuck? Marcy comes out behind me wearing a towel around her body. You can't walk around like that, you look ridiculous. What? Who fucking cares, Marcy? This is new times, and I can wear what I fucking well want. Darren, you are naked. Wearing office shoes. Hands on hips, she looks at me seriously. They don't care. I nod to the mass of undead drooling away nearby. And anyone with enough mind left to notice what I'm wearing will be dead within a few minutes anyway, so fuck them. I'm not going anywhere with you dressed like that. Well, I'm not putting anything else on. Take that towel off and let the air get to your body. It feels wonderful and liberating. No way. Why not? Because they'll see. She nods at the horde and clutches the towel tight around her bosoms. Marcy, they don't care. They're just like dogs now. They couldn't give a fuck if we dressed as clowns. She looks suspiciously at the horde, watching to see if they stare at her. Slowly, she plucks the corner of the towel out and lets the garment fall to the ground. See? Are any of them perving over you? I stare around at the horde who have shown no reaction whatsoever to Marcy standing there in the buff. Big boy is staring. Marcy looks at the hulking teenage zombie staring at her with utter awe. He always stares at you anyway. He's got a thing for motherly types, so let him have a thrill. Motherly types? I'm not that fucking old. No, I mean you turned him and stroked his face when he went under and came back, so he probably sees you like a mother figure, like he did with his stepmum. He was having sex with his stepmum, she replies coldly. Well, yeah, fuck it, I know what I mean. I think he's getting an erection, Darren. Marcy watches the bulge grow in the groin of the roided zombie man-child. So he is, dirty fucker. At least he finds me attractive, she mutters. I find you attractive, very attractive. He shows it, she points at the now stiffened tent peg straining against his stained jogging bottoms. Well, go and fuck him then, I say, exasperated. Maybe I will, she retorts quickly. Do that and I'll cut his dick off and stuff it down his throat. Oh, so you can get jealous then? I'm the super zombie, so he can look all he wants, but he doesn't get to touch what's mine. Yours? she asks, archly. Mine, Marcy. I stare at her defiant eyes. Ours, 
She hisses back at me. Mine, I growl back. Ours, Darren. You'd be fucking dead by now if it wasn't for me. You'd have charged after them and blundered about getting killed and ruining everything. It was my idea to turn this lot. My idea. Her voice screams out, making the veins in her neck bulge out. I meant your mind, not them. I wave my arm at the horde, all standing there patiently. They're ours, but you're mine. Oh, I thought you meant they're yours, she calms instantly. No, you're mine. They're ours. You just said that. I'm saying it again. Well, I'm glad we got that cleared up. Now, can we please get on? We've still got a lot left to do. Like what? I ask, confused as hell. We need more bodies she says, as though talking to a simpleton. We've got loads. Turning round, I make a point of looking at the horde crammed into the front garden and backed up in the street all across the road. Most of them have been turned by me or Marcy, but others are zombies that were already here and have tagged along for the ride. We should get more, she says, stiffly crossing her arms. Oh, Marcy, can't we just go and get Howie now? No, Darren, we're doing it properly this time. There will be time for playing later, but we're going to keep going until I think we have enough. Oh, fucking hell, that'll take ages. Stop your whining and get on with it. Still naked, she strides past me through the gate and into the road. And put some bloody trousers on. Five. We thought it was you, but we had to be sure the balding man says. The second man has pulled his balaclava off to reveal a hard face topped with thick brown hair. We're standing round with weapons held down at our sides, still not confident enough to put them away just yet, and I can sense Dave and Clarence keeping a discreet distance. Howie, good to meet you. I extend my hand out to the balding man who swaps the gun over to free his right hand up. Dean, that's my cafe behind you. Your group are with us, safe and sound. He shakes hands firmly and steps back to look round at us, finally settling his gaze on Lani. You're a local, aren't you? He asks with a puzzled expression. She is. We met her down the road, I reply quickly. Where are our group? Can we see them? They're downstairs in the bunkers. We'll take you down. Has anyone followed you? No, Dave says, firmly staring hard at Dean. Let's get under cover quickly. Follow me. Dean turns to head back towards the recessed door he appeared from. Before we go, what are they doing there? I point towards the tennis courts. I'll tell you once we're inside, not here. Dean replies, moving back towards the door. I'd rather know now, mate. The others take their lead from me and remain still. It's not safe out here. We should get under cover, Dean says quickly. No offence, mate, but we don't know you or what's in there. I feel the tension rising again, and although Dave hasn't moved an inch, I can tell he's poised to react. I understand. Mike, go and get someone from his group and bring them up. Dean turns back to me, then glances at the tennis courts. We're trying to see how long they survive without food or water. And? I ask. Some of them have been in there since the first night it happened, he replies. What about the dead ones? What happened to them? Some died on their own, and we chucked in another few bodies to see if they would eat their own or what would happen, but they haven't touched the corpses. We put cups of water in there, and they ignored them. Then we chucked fresh and rotten animal meat in, but they ignored that too. Do they change at night? Clarence asks. They howl like the rest of them and then get faster and meaner, chucking themselves at the fence. We put a guard out to make sure they don't break the fence down. Howie! Sarah comes running out of the door straight into my arms. The shock hits me hard and I hug her fiercely, feeling tears stinging my eyes. Sarah, oh thank God! I hear the others crowding in. She breaks free and hugs them each in turn, and even Dave doesn't object to the physical contact. Finally, she grabs Clarence and throws her arms round his huge chest. He blushes bright red, 
but returns the embrace, lifting her clean off her feet in a giant bear hug. Oh, Howie, she says again, when Clarence finally releases her. We thought you'd be gone. We thought all of you would be gone. Tears spill from her eyes as we hug again. What happened at the end? Where's Tucker and the others? She looks round and sees the desperately sad looks of the lads. They didn't make it. I shake my head and feel tears falling down my own cheeks. Looking over, I see Blowers and Cookie have also gone red-eyed and silent. Howie! Dave! Thank God for that! Ted comes striding out of the door and clasps my hand with both of his. Ted! Oh, it's good to see you, mate. I smile with genuine pleasure and shake his hand vigorously. Come here, you bloody hero! Ted gives me a brief hug before breaking free to greet each of us in turn, shaking hands and seeing the tears falling from all of us. Lani stares, bemused at the emotive reunion. Within seconds, more of our group are pouring from the door. Sergeant Hopewell, Tom and Stephen, Terry and more faces we last saw in the fort when they were running for their lives out of the rear gate. I catch a quick glimpse of Dean standing there shrugging at his mate. Both of them look worried, and I know we should do as they ask, but seeing our group takes over anything else. Blowers, Cookie and Nick get treated like the heroes they are, and I watch them crying with bittersweet sorrow, relief, happiness, heart-wrenching sadness as we're all bombarded with people asking who survived, women and children demanding to know if their husbands, fathers or brothers lived or died. To this group... We are the returning heroes who survived something that none of us expected to walk away from. The horror and desperation we faced on that battlefield, we faced for them. So they would live and have a chance of freedom. They know this, and the strain they must have been under since they left is huge, and to see us now brings those emotions out in all of us. Sobbing and crying, I try desperately to answer people as they ask about their loved ones, but I simply didn't know the names of all of the men we fought alongside. There wasn't time to learn them. In the end, Sergeant Hopewell and Ted assert their natural authority and start herding them back inside the door. As the crowd grows thinner, a few of us are left standing close together, tears drying, and I see Sarah hugging a crying Clarence as he tells her about the loss of Malcolm. Blowers, Cookie and Nick are all being patted and hugged as they talk of Tucker, Curtis and Jamie laying down their lives while Stephen, Tom, Terry and Jane all listen intently. You made it then, Ted says with fatherly pride to me. Just about. It was awful, Ted. I shake my head at the memory. We lost so many, so many. I don't know how to tell them. I motion towards the backs of the women and children filing back into the doorway. They're expecting it, Ted says bluntly. We didn't expect to see any of you again. Uh, I'm sorry, but I really would prefer it if we got back inside. Dean comes forward, speaking politely. Of course, mate, I'm so sorry. No, we understand. We've heard all about you and what happened over there, but we've kept this place pretty clear up till now and we'd rather keep it that way. Come through, Howie. You'll be amazed at this place. Ted starts ushering the others inside, and I wait at the back to go through with Dave. That was intense, I mutter quietly to him. Good to see them all again, though, Mr Howie. Dave gives a rare smile. Your sister looks well? They've obviously been well looked after. Come through. Dean stands a few feet into the recessed area, holding a thick barred gate open and motioning us to enter. We do as we're told and enter a long tunnel. Dean pulls the gate closed and fastens thick bolts home on the inside and then big padlocks at the top and bottom. Finally, he steps in and then closes a thick wooden door, sealing in darkness. A torch lights up within a few seconds and we watch him ramming more bolts home before squeezing past us and leading the way through the dark tunnel. The battery was built back in the 1850s, but then during the World Wars they added more tunnels and bunkers. They used it for all sorts of secret testing back in the day, before the council closed most of them up and said they'd all fallen in or collapsed. We broke through when this happened and found nearly all of them were perfectly fine. 
There's a whole network of tunnels connecting rooms and bunkers. We've managed to get loads of food and bottled water down here. Thank you for taking our group in, Dean. The air is musty, but it feels much cooler down here, and I realise the winding tunnel is going downhill and getting a bit steeper every few metres. We didn't have much choice, if I'm honest. They turned up making a whole load of noise, and that sergeant woman and your sister promised they would only stay for a few days. We couldn't just leave them out there to die. Dean shrugs as he walks ahead of us. The dark tunnel turns to the right and opens into a large room illuminated by the glow of many candles and lanterns. The room is sectioned off with distinct bundles of bedding and clothing marking out separate sleeping areas. A cacophony of voices reaches us from the many women either sitting or standing around talking. Some children run about in excitement and others sit in forlorn shock looking pale and drawn. Faces turn to stare as we file through, following Dean and the others ahead of him. Doors lead off to more rooms, crammed with people sitting, lying or standing about quietly talking. We follow Dean through more tunnels, these ones lit by hanging gas lanterns or strings of fairy lights strung up and connected to car batteries. We enter another large room, again filled with women and children and pass more smaller rooms, these ones clearly filled with local people who have had time to gather belongings from home or other places, bedding and soft furnishings, pictures of loved ones, shelves of books and children's toys. There are more men here, and it's clear the best rooms have been reserved for the locals who got here first. Dean shows us to a large central room stocked with tinned food and bottled water, a guard, armed with a shotgun, sits on a chair, reading an old newspaper. He nods amiably as we pass into yet more rooms, filled with food, water, cans of beer and spirits. We've been out foraging and bringing supplies in every day. We've avoided this town and gone into the villages to raid houses, pubs, shops and anything else we can find. There's a fresh water supply in here too, drawn from somewhere deep underground. We use that mainly and keep the bottles in case it runs dry or something. We've got a few nurses and a vet, but no doctor yet. But we did manage to get into a couple of pharmacies and doctor's surgeries and empty the shelves, so we've got medicines, antibiotics and penicillin. Bandages are boiled and sterilised, then resealed, and we allow body washes every few days on a rotation basis. How many have you got down here? I ask, amazed at the effort that's already gone into setting all this up. We had a couple of hundred before your lot arrived, so now we're bursting. He stops and looks back at me seriously. Will you be able to take them away today or tomorrow? Definitely, mate, as soon as we can get them back to the boats and the tide is right. We don't mind having them and we've got enough food and water, but, well, you know how it is. His voice trails off diplomatically. I can imagine, Dean. You've got a good setup here. And why should you take in strangers? Sounds harsh and I apologise for that, but survival is just that. Survival. Through more tunnels and we reach another large room. This one clearly used by Dean and his family or closest friends. A large table and chairs in the middle and more doors running round the edge of the room. Most of them closed, but the few open reveal beds, easy chairs and stacks of food and water. Sergeant Hopewell and the others are all standing in the main middle room waiting as Dave and I file in. One side of the table is reserved for Dave, Clarence, me and the lads. We all sit down as trays of hot coffee are brought out from one of the rooms and placed on the table. Dean and a few members of his black-clad group take seats opposite us. Everyone else either grabs a free chair or leans against the walls. More people emerge until the room is nearly full with everyone waiting for our account. I see Lani watching us, and I give her a smile and a nod. She must know some of the people down here already, but I can see she's positioned herself so she's close to the lad sitting at the end of the table. A silence descends after we've grabbed coffee mugs and taken a few sips, added sugar and stirred them round. The room feels hot and muggy, with so many people crammed together and breathing in the confined area. Expectant faces stare at me. People want the full story, and not just the snatched bits they got outside. Taking a deep breath, I start to relay the account from when they left the fort, 
The battle, the fighting, and who I knew we lost, who survived, all the rows of injured people stacked up inside the fort when we came back through. I tell them how Darren escaped and how we figured they'd come here, then how we saw Darren last night and the fight in the hotel. Clarence jumps in a few times when he senses me going quiet and trying to get my thoughts in order. Blowers too adds bits here and there. We explained the whole thing until we met Lani and started working our way along to here. At the mention of Lani's name, everyone turns to stare at her. She goes poker-faced and nods once in greeting before staring out with the same expressionless face I've seen on Dave so many times. So you think they're massing now? Dean asks, leaning forward. Yes, Dave answers in his flat voice. He will be turning as many as he can before it gets to night, then he'll come for us. How will he know where you are? Dean asks. He must have access to local knowledge by now, Dave answers. He leans forward to stare at Dean. I think from the way he controlled all of his people before, he must be able to get in their heads or something, and if he finds those things you've got in the tennis courts, he'll know you're here. He can try all he wants. This place is locked up tight, Dean answers confidently. More of his group nod in agreement. What about you, I ask? How come you're dressed like that? Believe it or not, he smiles, I ran a zombie event in the park every year. Park of the Dead, we called it. We got loads of people dressed up and took customers round on a sort of themed walk. We had uniformed soldiers as part of the show. He shrugs with a sheepish smile. We figured we might as well put them to use. Bloody hell, mate. Talk about reality and fantasy merging. Yeah, something like that, he laughs in good humour. What weapons do you have? Dave asks, and I almost chuckle at the scripted way he thinks. Fortification, defence, weapons, food, fluid and rest. Shotguns, rifles and loads of ammunition. That's it. Uh, if this Darren is gathering loads of them zombie things to come here for them, one of the women cuts in from behind Dean, why are we letting them stay here? I don't mean to be rude, but they're putting everyone else at risk. That's a good point, Dean turns to me. If you go now, we might be able to survive without being found. True. Won't happen, Dave cuts in. Darren is here now. Even if we wait outside so he can eat us alive, he won't stop at that. But if it's you he wants, the woman asks in a blunt tone. It is, Dave replies. Until he gets us, then what? What do you think he will do then? But you being here is putting us at risk. The woman's voice rises and several of her group nod in agreement. It's late afternoon now. The tide was in this morning, so I'm guessing it's out now. We have to wait until it comes back in before we can get the boats out. There's nothing we can do until then. I try to explain politely. I can see her point, and if I was in her place, I would be thinking exactly the same. It'll be getting dark by the time the tide comes back in, and by that time he'll have every fucking zombie here trying to get in. Dean, do something, she shouts. What? I can't just kick them out. You heard what he said. The tide's out, so they can't use the boats, and we can't leave them outside until night. And what about when they get here? Another voice shouts from the back. What then? More voices join in with both sides arguing amongst themselves. Quiet! Dean bangs on the table a few times until the shouting dies down. I'm sorry, Howie, but they're right. If you stay here and we get surrounded, then we can't get in or out until they either go away or die. And judging by the ones in the tennis court, they'll last a long time. It puts us all at risk. Silence descends again and the tension rises. It seems clear to me what we have to do. I look at Dave, who nods in agreement, then down the row at Clarence, Nick, Blowers and Cookie. They can see it too, what needs to be done, and they nod back at me. Then we'll go and meet them, I say to a stunned room. Leaning forward, I look Dean in the eye. We'll go and meet them before they get here, but you promise me that you'll get our people to their boats as soon as it's safe. 
Howie, no! Sarah shouts in shock. More voices join in, but we sit there, resolute, knowing there is no other choice. We've come this far to protect them. Why fail now? Are you serious? Dean asks with a puzzled look. Yes, mate, we'll go out and head them off. If we can find somewhere defensible and get them round us, then, like you said, there's no reason for them to come here and find you. That's suicide, Howie, Ted shouts angrily. We can draw them inland. Clarence's deep voice rumbles through the melee of noise. If we lure them away from here and keep them busy for a few hours, then it gives Dean a chance to get everyone to the boats in the morning. Sounds good to me, mate. I nod back. Lads? I look down, knowing what they'll say, but a twisted part of me wants this lot to see just how brave these lads are and what the word sacrifice really means. I'm in, Mr Howie, Nick says with a smile. Don't even need to ask, Mr Howie. Cookie gives a big grin, then takes a nonchalant glance around the room. It'll give us a chance to fuck Darren up too, Blowers adds with a nod. Dave? I stare at Dean and look along the faces of the people staring back in shock and confusion. Yes, Mr Howie? You up for another scrap, mate? Do you need to ask, Mr Howie? You're not doing that again, Sarah shouts in blind anger. Not again, Howie. You did it once and that was enough. We stay together from now on. She's right, Howie. All of you, Ted says firmly. Uh, may I say something? Lani suddenly speaks up, her voice strong and confident. Every face turns to look at her. We've only seen them slow in the day, but fast at night, right? She looks round, getting nods from most of the room. But you said, Mr Howie, that they can switch quickly and get faster during the day too, right? That's right. But you also said that they don't appear to be able to sustain that frantic pace for long, that it weakens them and it makes them easier to kill, right? Yeah? I nod back at her, unsure of where she's going with this. And you said this place is locked up tight, right? She looks at Dean, who nods back. So why not let them come here and go crazy all night, really get them going and get them exhausted? Then when daylight comes and they get slow, we go out and kill them. And like you said, Mr. Howie, if they're still fast, then they'll be weaker. Another stunned silence fills the room. Why didn't you think of that, Dave? I ask quietly. Sorry, Mr. Howie. It's a good idea, though. Rare praise from Dave, but Lani doesn't know him well enough to understand the raised eyebrows from the rest of our group. Very good idea, but only if Dean and his group agree. If not, then we honour their decision and take the fight straight to Darren. Agreed, Lani says with a nod, then looks round at us all, staring at her. Sorry, I just, uh... Dean? He nods several times, deep in thought, staring past me. Let me have five minutes to see what my uh, people think. He hesitates on calling them his people, like he is uncomfortable with the division of entities. Them and us. Not just people, but tribes distinct and diverse. We're all people, Sarah picks up on the mood. We all have a right to life and we should work together, not cast each other out. We wouldn't do that to you if you came to our fort. She's right. A man with a rich baritone voice steps forward. I won't stand by and watch you throw these people out, and if they go to fight them, I'll go with them. He turns to address the crowd gathered behind Dean. His rich voice fills the room, and he speaks like a barrister or someone used to addressing the public. We can hide in here forever, but going on what we've heard, it's only a matter of time before they come for us. Our children need sunlight and air. We need to plant food and think of the future. Hiding down here won't get that done. We need to accept this has happened and make decisions that benefit all of us. And when I say all of us, I mean the people that are left and not just our so-called group down here. You're wrong, the woman shouts. She is middle-aged with a stern face. We took the time and effort to make this place sustainable, so we have the right to be safe here. 
What if this place became unusable? Sarah cuts in quickly. What would you do then, if you knew there was another safe place nearby? That's not the point, the woman shouts back. It's exactly the point, the man with the baritone voice interjects. If we lost this place, then we'd have to go and ask for help from someone else, and that could happen. Why put ourselves and our children at risk for people we don't know? The woman shouts louder, clearly annoyed at having a member of her own group turn on her. But we do know them, the man replies. They're here, and we've met them, so we do know them. What's next? We start having tribal fought wars at the same time as fighting the zombies out there? This is utterly ridiculous. We should be out there doing what we can to get rid of them. Don't be so bloody stupid, the woman screams with blind fury. Are you suggesting that we go out there and hunt them down? Have you seen what they're capable of? Howie, the man turns to me suddenly. How many have you killed? Me, personally, or all of us together? Your group, how many? Bloody hell, Dave could probably tell you the actual number. Uh, 12,428. Dave says flatly. Jesus, mate, have you really been counting them? Our whole group stares at him, shocked. No, I made it up. I don't know how many. Dave gives a very small smile, which causes Blowers, Cookie, Nick and I to burst out laughing at the exceptionally rare attempt at humour from this quiet man. Sorry, I don't know, but it's got to be thousands. We killed loads just travelling round, but then we had that big fight a couple of days ago, and that would have wiped out several thousand of them. More than that, Clarence says thoughtfully. If you think about what you told us about Salisbury, then London, then our commune, and the last fight. He trails off with both eyebrows raised. Think about how many the GPMG took out, Nick adds. And those trenches we blew up, Cookie muses. The housing estate, that must have killed a couple of thousand on its own, Nick rubs his chin, thinking. Yeah, fair one. I nod back and turn to look round at the people staring at me. We've probably taken out tens of thousands then. With how many of you? The man asks like a friendly barrister, cross-examining a star witness. Not that many, really. We lost a few here and there, but on the whole, we've stayed remarkably intact for such a small group. Don't get me wrong, we lost thousands during that big fight outside our fort, but we killed far more than we lost, and what we've gained from that is a real chance of living safely for a while. And it's not just that, but we learned how to fight them, what hurts them, when to stand our ground and when to retreat. I guess more than anything, we learned not to fear them entirely. I look round to see everyone hanging on my words. They're frightening and all that, truly terrifying really, but they're not the superhuman monsters you think they are. You've seen what they're like in the daytime from your tennis court experiment. Bloody hell, any one of my lot could take down a horde three or four times that size with just a knife if they stayed like that. I sense all the lads sitting up higher at the compliment. But the real strength is having complete faith in your mates beside you, Clarence jumps in, his deep voice and large frame mesmerising the people watching us, knowing that they'll stand on the line and hold their courage. Bloody hell, you said you've loads of shotguns here. I look directly at Dean, who nods in response. They are devastating to a packed horde. Form a couple of lines up and have synchronised firing. Front line fires while rear line loads and just blast them away. Use the multiple exits you've got here to run out and shoot a load and get back in. Then find another door and do it again. Darren's only got a day, so even he can't muster that many. A thousand at the most, Dave adds, and I wish he hadn't, because a thousand sounds like a massive number. It is a massive number. I groan inwardly as mouths start to drop open at hearing it. A thousand? The woman asks loudly. At the most, Dave shrugs. Dean, you've heard what these men have said. The man with the rich voice picks up his thread quickly. Even if they do bring a thousand or five thousand, it means we can finish them off and have a chance at living in safety. 
I look at Dean, who remains expressionless, clearly thinking hard. Mate, whatever you decide, we'll stand by. If you want us to go out and head them off, we will on the condition that you promise to get our group to the boats as soon as possible. You'd go out against a thousand of them, Dean asks me seriously. Yes. At night? Yes, mate. Have you seen Dave fight? Trust me, the odds aren't that bad. What, that little thing? The woman's scornful tones cut through the room as the lads all take a sharp intake of breath, and I glance over to see Sarah, Ted and the officers all looking shocked. Only Dave stays as devoid of expression as ever. That little thing has probably killed more of them than the rest of us put together, Clarence's voice seethes with anger, going red in the face as he stands up, his massive frame seeming to dominate the room. The lads stand with him and look equally as angered. That little thing is the bravest man I have ever met, and I've been in more combat zones than you could count. He leans forward and presses his fists into the table, which creaks under his weight. And that Little thing would willingly go out there alone against 10,000 if he was asked. Excuse me, I need some air. He turns to find a sudden gap opening up, which he strides through with Sarah hot on his heels. I think we all do, I reply. Sorry to ask, but have you got sentries or lookouts posted? Yeah, all round, Dean replies. Good. Then we're going outside to cool off and let you talk in peace. We turn to file out, and I wait to hear someone say we can't go outside, but thankfully they seem distracted, and no one yells after us. As I walk through the first tunnel, the man with the rich voice runs to catch up with me. Paul, he extends a hand to shake. I'm sorry about that, but tensions are high, as you can see. Nice to meet you, Paul. Don't worry, but that woman was getting offensive, and after what we've been through, you can't blame the lads for reacting that way. God, no, I'm amazed you stayed as cool as you did. Listen, we'll have a proper chat and come and find you when it's done. Thanks, mate. I appreciate that. Dean is a very decent man. He might have looked quiet back there, but the man has a steel rod running through his core. We leave Paul in one of the big rooms to head back and speak to Dean while we thread our way through the complex of tunnels and bunkers. Word spreads as we go through that we're going outside, and suddenly... Many people are heading for the doors and exits. They've been cooped up in here since this began, Ted explains as we walk through the darkened tunnels. Shit, I'm starting to wish I hadn't said we're going out now. It'll just look like we're trying to undermine Dean. I don't think you could stop them if you tried, Howie, Ted replies with a smile. We follow the crowds out through a different route to a door further back in the park. Coming out into the car park, and I see our inner group all standing to one side. Some of the local guards look very unhappy at nearly all the fort's residents suddenly pouring out for a few minutes of sunshine and fresh air. Standing together, we look over at children racing to the play area, screaming and yelling with delight while worried-looking parents run after them, telling them to be quiet. Hey, mate! I shout up at one bemused-looking guard standing on the top of the wall. We'll go to the top where we came in and keep guard if you want. Cheers, mate. The man smiles and gives a thumbs up before speaking into a small radio fastened to the front of his black overalls. We file through the car park towards the entrance. Looking round, I see nearly our whole group here. The officers, Sarah and Clarence, the lads and Lani, Dave and even that woman that helped Sarah in the back of the van on the way from London to the fort. Stephen and Tom both keep sneaking glances at the sawn-off shotguns wedged into the backpacks of the lads and looking down at their own full-length double-barrelled weapons. We find a spot on the grassy area by the pitch and putt and settle down in a wide semicircle angled to watch the entrance path. I'll go and have a quick look up there, Mr Howie, Dave says, indicating the path. I'll come with you, Lani adds quickly. Nodding at both of them, I wonder why she's chosen our group to stand by when surely this lot would have taken her in, seeing as she's a local. Howie, you can't be serious at going to head them off. That was a bloody stupid thing to say. Sarah wastes no time in voicing her opinion. What choice do we have? 
Plenty of choices, Howie, Sergeant Hopewell cuts in. I see where you're coming from, but you've already marched out to battle once and no one is expecting you to do it again. I disagree, Blowers interrupts. If this lot don't want us and they get all nasty, then they can make life very hard for our people. If it means they get a chance of getting back safely, then we have to do it. Simon, you don't have to keep saving everyone, Sarah replies. Simon? Who's Simon? I ask, confused. <laughs> Me, that's my first name, Blowers laughs. Shit, I'd forgotten you even had one. Stop changing the subject, Howie, Sarah chides as Nick and Cookie both laugh and start ragging Blowers by calling him Simon. Sarah, we're not being heroes, but if it has to be done, then so be it. You lot are getting addicted to killing them, that's what it is, Sarah says firmly. I could see it in your faces before that big fight, and downstairs, it's like a thrill to you, being all heroic and going out against thousands of them like that. No, it's not, Clarence cuts across her. Then what is it? Because I don't understand. Surely it would be better to sit and wait it out here than risk dying again. How many chances do you need? She looks round first at Clarence, then me, and finally at the lads. How many times are you going to risk your lives until every zombie is dead? Are you going to go out and kill all of them? Just you few? Nah, we'll just send Dave, Cookie mutters. Don't be funny, Alex, Sarah retorts quickly, and I watch as Cookie sinks lower from the sudden tongue lashing. Right, I'll tell you what, she looks round at us again. If you go out there, then I'm coming with you. Oh, hang on, I start to say, getting cut off by protests from the others too. And me, Terry speaks for the first time, and I can see from her face that she means it. Oh no, just wait a minute. Me too. Ted looks as serious as the others. All of us, Sergeant Hopewell joins in. Can we saw our shotgun ends off too? Be quiet, Stephen. Sorry, Sarge. For fuck's sake, I say, exasperated. What? Terry asks. What is it, Howie? If you're saying that it's so important to save these women and children that you'd go out and fight another battle, then why not us too? Well, because we don't have children. She adds, without letting me speak. We're just as capable as you at fighting and defending our group. We can shoot guns and swing axes about the same as you can. None of you are combat trained, Clarence replies quickly, but gets shot down instantly by Sarah. He's a supermarket manager, she points at me, and they were on their first day in the army. She moves her pointing hand to the lads. But they've got experience now, he rumbles. And how did they get that experience? Terry asks. By being herded away and kept safe? No, by getting out there and fighting, that's bloody how. I agree, Lani adds in her strong, confident voice. I've only just joined, and I'm sorry for interrupting, she adds. Don't be sorry, Sarah smiles up at her. Here, sit down, I'm Sarah. But I've killed a few of them, and I've already decided that if you go out there, then I'm coming too. Why? Nick asks quickly. They killed my family. They killed everyone I know. So why is it just your right to get revenge? Lani replies, looking up, proud and defiant. It's not about revenge, I say. Yes, it is, Sergeant Hopewell cuts in. When you and Dave came to the police station that day, you said you had to find your sister. But you found her, Howie, and now she's safe. So why keep going? Well, because she needs to get back to the fort, I reply weakly. Oh, that's big of you, Sarah growls at me. Why do I need to get back? Why am I different to everyone else here? Ah, oh, this is getting silly, I throw my hands up. Dave, what do you think? Sarah turns to Dave, sitting quietly next to me. He looks at me for long seconds, blank-faced, before answering. Men fight. Always have done. Men fight to protect their families and what they hold dear. Men fight for all sorts of reasons, but that's just the way it is. Thank you, Dave. I smile, feeling like I've won the point. But so do women, he adds to my audible groan. Women fight harder than men when they need to. Women can be ferocious in battle. Ask Clarence. The big man nods reluctantly. Cheers, Dave, I groan. That's okay, Mr. Howie. I was being sarcastic. I know. Well, 
I'm glad that's cleared up then, Sarah smiles triumphantly, and I look round to see nearly everyone grinning and Ted shaking his head with a small knowing smile. You walked into that one, son, he says. Yeah, I get that impression. So can we saw the ends off now? Stephen asks hopefully. Yes, mate, if we all go out together, then you can saw the ends off. Brill! He sounds delighted and gets a stern look of disapproval from the sergeant. Clarence and I exchange unhappy glances, and he shrugs his huge shoulders like two boulders lifting up and down. If nothing else, it's worth it to see that, Ted says after a few minutes' silence. I follow his gaze to the playground and the children running about freely. Some of the parents join in on the monkey bars and roundabout. Others stand around with a mixture of happy and worried faces. Their laughter and giggles sound out into the quiet summer air, and I can imagine this place being crammed during a normal summer day. A ball gets kicked onto the grass and bounces over towards us, and I watch Nick starting to shrug his backpack off discreetly. Cookie catches the movement and starts doing the same both of them speeding up to beat the other one until Lani ditches her bag into the middle and sprints past them, laughing. With shouts, they burst up and start sprinting for the ball as Blower slowly stubs his cigarette out and starts taking his pack off too. Lani reaches the ball first and kicks it back to the children just as she's joined by Nick and Cookie. Within seconds, a game has started with items of clothing being set down as goals and the children trying to beat our group. More children come running up as Stephen and Tom both join in too, laughing and calling for the ball. Looks like they need a goalie. Clarence surprises us all by jogging over, leaving the rest of us now minding several axes, shotguns and backpacks. When did you start smoking again? Sarah calls out as she catches me lighting one up and blowing a lazy plume of smoke out. Uh, today actually. It's bad for you, she chides. So are zombies, I retort quickly. Clarence takes over in goal, squatting down to get ready for some saves until one plucky child shouts that he's too big and the goal has to be made bigger. There's Dean. Dave nods past me at the approaching man accompanied by several of his group. Getting slowly to my feet, I walk a few paces forward and watch as he tells his friends to wait and walks on to speak with me alone. Greeting me with a nod, he stands watching the children play for a couple of minutes, and I get the impression he's still trying to make a final decision. It would have been okay if he hadn't mentioned there could be a thousand of them, he says finally. I don't know where he got that number from, Dean. It's possible, though, isn't it? Yeah, it is, I sigh, already knowing what the answer is. We lock eyes for a second, and I feel pleased that despite the bad news, he has the decency to look me in the eye. I'm sorry, Howie, but we put it to a vote, and, well, don't worry, mate, I pretty much expected it. If it's any consolation, I voted for you to stay, but they just got hung up on the thought of a thousand of those things coming this way. Yeah, fair one. If it hadn't been for Sarah and the others saying they'd be coming with us, it wouldn't bother me so much. But the thought of leading my sister and the rest of them into a fight like that is just awful. Looking over, I see them all staring at me and Dean, and I wonder if they can work out what's being said from our body language. But we still honour the promise of getting the rest of them to the boats as soon as possible. OK, mate, I appreciate that. Listen, there's a few more that are coming out with us now. Have you got any spare weapons we can take? We can spare a few shotguns and some ammunition and we've got a couple of other bits and pieces too. I'll get them ready for you. Cheers, mate. No hard feelings. I extend my hand, which he takes with a firm grasp. So you've been given the bad news then, Paul says as he strides towards us, a sour expression twisting his features. It's no problem, Paul. We did make the offer in the first place. I think it's fucking terrible, he spits. And I stand by what I said, too. I will be going with you, and so will a few others. Paul. Dean turns to the man with a worried look. No, Dean, it's not on. It's just not on. Paul waves his hand as his voice rises. It's utterly barbaric to send these people out and let them do the dangerous work so we can stay in safety here. You heard what they said. Those fucking things will come for us no matter if these people are here or not. Paul, we put it to a vote, Dean says patiently, and I can tell he doesn't really believe in what he's saying. 
Yes, we did, Dean, but that doesn't mean I have to like it, and I made it perfectly clear that if you choose to send them out, then I would be going too. That's your decision, Paul. Dean sighs, walking off. His shoulders slumped in defeat. I'll get some weapons ready, Howie. Thank you. With a sinking heart, I wait for Dean to leave, then glance over to see Clarence and Dave both staring at me. My look tells them everything they need to know, and they both nod back at me. We better get ready, I say to Paul. Suddenly feeling there's nothing else to say, I walk away back towards my group. Clarence, Dave and the lads walk across to intercept me. We're going out then, Clarence asks, wiping sweat from his face. Yep, my response is curt. I don't want them to come with us, he growls with quiet intensity. It doesn't feel right. I agree, Mr Howie, Nick adds quickly. No offence, but we've got this far together and we know how to fight alongside each other. Look at last night, we held fucking shitloads of them off for hours on our own, Cookie swears with as much intensity as Clarence. I don't like it any more than you do. I reply, watching Sarah and the others looking at us. We could get them inside and just move out quickly, Clarence urges. Get Dean or whoever to lock the doors and not let them out. She'll go fucking nuts. They all know I mean Sarah. She can go nuts, but at least she'll be alive, Clarence says. They're coming over, Blowers mutters quietly. Turning round to face them, we couldn't look guiltier if we tried, and I watch Sarah's facial expression change as she gets close enough to speak. I know exactly what you're thinking, and it won't bloody work, she looks at each of us in turn. Dean said we can stay the night, Cookie tries lying, but it falls instantly flat, and his voice trails off as Sarah, Terry, and Sergeant Hopewell fix him with a trio of hard stares. Did he? Sergeant Hopewell asks Cookie quietly, but the tone leaves no doubt of her ability to see through him. No, Cookie mumbles, looking down, and we all feel the same guilt for trying to deceive them. Right, so we're going out to meet them. A statement, not a question, as Terry looks straight at me. I'm not having this. Clarence draws himself up to his full height, plants his feet apart, folds his massive arms, and inflates his chest to stare down at them. Not having what? Sarah smiles at him sweetly, skillfully avoiding drawing a confrontation out, knowing that's what he's trying to do. Not having you coming with us. His voice drops to a deeper rumble. Sarah looks up at him with a loving gaze and gives a small smile. The big man hesitates just for a split second, but it's enough to show her he's lost the battle of wills. How do you want to do this? Sergeant Hopewell asks in a businesslike manner. Do this? I can feel my temper starting to fray. Do this? Have you any idea what you're going into? We've been fighting alongside each other solidly for nine days now, and we've learnt to move together, to anticipate each other's movements. We know instinctively when to press forward and when to drop back. We've learnt that through nine fucking days of solid fucking fighting. So forgive me, but it'll be us fucking doing this. You, I point at them, will just get in the fucking way. Silence for several seconds. And stupidly, I feel maybe I've gone too far and caused serious offence. Still clinging on to cultural values and the strict moral codes of our society. But even more stupidly, I press on, ramming the point home. I get it. We all get it, OK? We get your point that it's not our job to save you and it's not our job to go and die for anyone. But, and please listen to this, we stand a better chance of surviving if it is just us. But, Terry goes to speak, but a hard look from me silences her. No buts, Terry, I continue with my ranting. And they still need someone to look out for them. Who is going to do that if we're all dead? What if they get off the boats on the other side and find another horde waiting for them? How are they going to get to the fort? Or shall we just call Chris and get him to come pick them up in his fleet of coaches? Howie, Sarah says softly. No, Sarah. If you had been fighting them for the length of time we had, and if those terrified women and children had someone else to look after them, then maybe it would be a good idea. But you didn't, and they don't. So it's a shit idea. 
How do we get experience if we don't start fighting them, Mr. Howie? Tom asks quietly, showing a rare serious side to his nature. Exactly, Sarah glares at me. And by fighting with you, we're taking away the biggest threat, which is Darren. And another thing, those women are not some incapable bunch of weaklings. They need to take responsibility for their own safety, and they can fire shotguns and swing axes as well as anyone. Stop being so fucking sexist. This isn't about being sexist. This isn't a workplace. This isn't some job where you can moan about equal rights or lack of fucking promotion for women. This is about having the right people to do the task at hand. And right now we, I wave my hand at the men standing by me, are the right people to do this simply because we've been doing it non-stop since this thing started. And we won't get experienced and as good as you unless we jump in and start fighting too, Terry yells back. Listen to me and listen well. I step forward and can feel pure fury threatening to explode. Every word I say comes out through gritted teeth and the rage that propelled me through so many fights and battles suddenly manifests itself, making every one of them recoil. This is how it is. We are going to head them off and you are going to take our people back to our fort. Do I make myself clear? I said, do I make myself clear? I look to each one in turn. Eyes drop away from my intense glare. Feet shuffle awkwardly, but the silence tells me I've finally got through. Okay. Sarah finally breaks the silence with a quiet response. You're right. You've got us this far. We need to get our people inside. Dave... Dean was going to get us some weapons. Find him and tell him we don't need them, but take whatever ammunition you can find. On it, Dave affirms, jogging away quickly with Lani running after him. Nick, Cookie, make sure all our bags have got water and food. Blowers and Clarence, I want you two to clean our weapons and make sure they're ready. Distribute the ammunition amongst the bags once Dave brings it back. They break away instantly, leaving me with the rest of our group standing in awkward silence. Howie? I want you to take Stephen and Tom with you. No, hang on, please let me finish. Sergeant Hopewell holds her hand up. They're good lads, young and fit, and they'll keep up. You do understand that while we accept your leadership at this time, I am still a police sergeant, and therefore recognised by any form of government to take control in times of extreme incidents. This is my decision, and you will offend me greatly, and these two, if you don't accept them into your group. They are both trained to take orders, and they will do as they are told when they are told. The rest of us can ensure the safety of everyone else. Owie, listen to the sergeant, Ted adds in his fatherly tone. You boys know what you're doing out there, and we accept that. But these lads are itching to get stuck in, and like they said, they need the experience, and there's no time like the present. I look at Stephen and Tom. My only experiences have been of them squabbling and playing the fool, but they're the same age as Nick, Blowers and Cookie, and I guess maybe there is a time to be a stubborn fool and a time to concede. Okay, lads, go and find Dave, get your shotgun sawn off, and ask Dave to find you some hand weapons to fight with when it starts getting nasty. Wait, I shout as they start running off. Make sure you have backpacks that the shotguns can fit into. We'll need to be light on our feet, and we cannot afford to be holding two weapons if we get caught out. Sir, they both shout back, and start jogging off towards the doors. I can see Terry is seething from the decision made by her sergeant, but Sarah just looks crestfallen and deeply worried. The local guards start moving into the park, ushering people back inside. The parents respond instantly with the conception that men with guns must be making the right decisions. Children cry with disappointment as they're pulled and carried away from the play area. We stroll over to the bags as Clarence and Blowers sit down quickly, breaking the shotguns open and cleaning them through. I go from bag to bag, taking all the shotgun cartridges out and putting them into a pile. Sarah drops down and starts helping me in stilted silence. We don't have enough pistols for Stephen and Tom. I scratch my head, already worrying about the smaller details that I know will keep us alive. They can have mine and Dave's, Clarence replies. You two are the best shots with them. It'd make more sense for me and one of the others to go without. 
true, but we're also less likely to need them. Clarence glances up with a wicked grin, breaking the tension with his barbed joke. Funny bugger, I mutter with a quiet laugh. Fuck it, I'll take two if you're going to argue, Cookie jokes. I can be like Bruce Willis and dive across the ground, firing both of them at the same time. And break your ribs and lie on the floor groaning like a twat, Blowers adds. Oh, and you'd like me lying on the floor groaning, wouldn't you? Face down by any chance, Cookie replies. That's what your mum said, Blowers laughs. Don't start on my mum. Well, don't start on the gay jokes then. I'm not, I just think it's about time you came out of the closet. Your mum wouldn't even fit in the closet. The lads banter. Clarence smiles and the world rolls on its gentle course as seconds pass into minutes. Before too long, the shotguns are cleaned and ready and the cartridges are redistributed evenly throughout the bags. The lads stand up, passing cigarettes round, and we enjoy a smoke in the warm summer air while we wait for Dave to come back so we can move out and pick another fight with a horde of zombies. 6. The next few hours are spent working our way further into the town, going from street to street and finding survivors everywhere. It surprises me that these fuckwits don't all get together and fortify one of their shitty little streets. We'd still get through eventually, but they would kill a few of us in the process and at least they would go out fighting instead of cowering under their beds, covered in their own piss and shit. These fucking pussies are just waiting to die, hiding in vain and convincing each other that help is coming and they just have to wait it out. Slaughtering them becomes so easy that if it wasn't for the sheer frenzied urge of ripping their flesh apart, it could almost become boring. I say almost because the urge is so strong that it could never actually become mundane. We get the tactic down to a fine art, entering the street quietly and going to the first house, breaking a window or simply sending a few heavy zombie bodies at it and smashing it open. Then I let them rip, sending them in fast and loud, and after that we just have to follow the scent of fear until we root them out to finish them off, screaming and wailing, begging for their lives. But they don't know what life is until they've tried this. A strange thing happened late in the afternoon which I kept to myself. We had entered one of the big suburban houses and I almost puked at the sight of more beige walls and cream carpets, not to mention the black and white artistically framed photograph of the occupants, all dressed in black jumpers and smiling unnaturally. I even saw a picture of a pebble, an actual photograph of a fucking pebble on a beach. Further down the hallway, I saw another framed picture of the same pebble, but this time it was on a picnic table. Then another with the pebble poised artfully next to a stream. What fucking moron took a pebble with them and took pictures of it in different scenes? Fucking arseholes. We found the occupants hiding as normal in the upstairs bedroom. And as normal, the mother took a fly in charge with a big knife, but she got dispatched quickly by Marcy. She was quite fit and attractive, and I stood there for a couple of minutes watching her bleed out while Marcy and some of our babies went into the room to finish the screaming brats off. While I was standing there, I heard a whimpering coming from another door. Following the sound, I found an adult male with a thick, bushy, dark beard hiding behind the shower curtain in the bathroom. As I pulled back the curtain, he pissed himself with fear, making me shake my head at his lack of bravery. I told him to kneel down, which he did willingly. Now if a deranged naked zombie walked into my bathroom and told me to kneel down, I'd be telling him to fuck off and throwing everything in sight at his zombie face. But this pussy just complied weakly and knelt down in the bathtub crying his eyes out. I'm going to bite you to death, I said to him, but he just stayed there whimpering. I'm going to bend down and sink my teeth into your neck and my infection will enter your bloodstream. You will die. And a couple of minutes later, you'll come back and be one of them stupid twats running around and drooling. He still didn't react, so I took it slow, bending over and nuzzling his exposed neck with my teeth. 
the fucker actually craned his head so I could get easier access, which just annoyed me, so I finished him off quickly with a big bite and watched with interest as he bled out, spraying crimson all over the white tiles like something from a Hitchcock film. With the same detached interest, I stood there waiting for him to come back. Eventually, he started twitching and convulsing until his eyes opened all red and bloodshot. The funny thing was that I didn't feel a connection to him. There was nothing. I probed and concentrated, but he just didn't exist in my mind. Wow. This feels strange, he said in a very normal way. You can talk, I asked him. It would appear so, he replied, and started shuffling round from his slumped position in the bathtub. Is that all my blood? he asked, with interest, pointing at the blood dripping down the walls. Yes, how can you talk? How on earth should I know? Can't they all talk? No. Well, you appear to be talking well enough. That's because I'm special. That woman can talk too, I heard you both. She's special too. Well, I guess I must be special too then. Here, give me a hand. I didn't like the way he said it as he stretched his arm out. He looked intelligent and cultured, refined and intellectual. Well, don't just stand there, my boy. Help me out. My boy? I am decidedly older than you, so my use of the phrase my boy is inherently one of the deepest respect, young man, so please don't just stand there. This blood is very slippery. I stood there watching him slip and slide with growing frustration until he eventually got a grip and stood up properly. He then stepped out of the bath and stood in front of me, examining my face and looking down at my naked body with a slight sneer. Why are you naked? Why not? Don't be surly, I asked you a question. You shouldn't speak to me like that. And why not? Because I'm in charge. Well, we shall see about that, young man. Now I am very hungry and I want you to show me how all this works. Darren, who are you talking to? Marcy called out from behind the bathroom door. Just myself, chattering away to myself. She pushed the door open and walked in to see me standing over the now properly dead man, pulling the toothbrush out of his eye socket, where I had slammed it in through to the brain. What happened to him? Oh, he got a bit chopsy, so I had to finish him off properly. He's not coming back then? Uh, no, my love, not this one. Oh well, missing one won't hurt. Here, I found these for you. She hands me a pair of blue jeans, and in my shocked state of having found not only a talking zombie, but one that clearly wanted to usurp me, take Marcy for himself and rule my babies, I took the jeans with just a smile and a nod. Are you OK? She looked at me quizzically. Yep, yeah, fine. I'll uh, get these on then, shall I? She watched me slip the shoes off and slide the jeans over my legs before bending to put the black office shoes back on. She coughed once, and I looked up to see her holding a pair of brown desert boots in her hand. You can't wear jeans with office shoes. Why not? They don't go. You'd look awful. Does it matter? Yes, it matters. Now put these on. I won't be seen dead with you dressed like that. But you are dead. We both are. That's not the point, and don't be surly. That's what he said. What? Nothing. Pass them here, then. The boots get pulled on, and I start doing the laces up to the top of the high eyelets. No, leave them a bit loose so the jeans tuck into the boots slightly. Here, like this. She bent down and fidgeted with them for a few seconds. And seeing as she was naked, I got a cracking good view of her cherry-shaped arse sticking out. Like that. Wow, you look good. No, you look really good like that with your top off. I feel stupid. No, you look so sexy. All rough and nasty. She purred, coming in close to run her hands over my chest. Oh, you nasty zombie. Coming to bite my neck and do bad things to me. She craned her head back, exposing her neck, which reminded me of the chatty beardy man at my feet, 
with a bright pink toothbrush sticking out his eye. Even so, the sight of her neck set something off in me, and I bit down. Not hard, but enough to draw a little blood which got her going straight away, digging her nails into my back and raking down hard enough to rip the flesh open. The same erotic feeling I had when she first turned flooded through me, and I gripped her harder, licking at the blood dripping down her neck. She in turn bit me on the shoulder and started probing her hot tongue into the wound, licking at the salty infected blood and sucking away. My hands groped round to her butt, my fingers brushing over the dried scab on the congealed wound. I started picking away at it, gently at first, then harder and harder, prizing the dried claret away and exposing the still unhealed flesh beneath. Groaning in ecstasy, she bit me again, which set me off more. Then she got inventive and unbuckled my jeans to pull them down round my ankles. She pushed me down onto the toilet seat and straddled me, impaling herself on my now hardened dead member. With continual biting, tearing and ripping of each other's flesh, we made love on a dirty toilet seat in a stranger's house, with a dead zombie watching us with one eye and a toothbrush sticking out his skull, not to mention the several members of our horde standing patiently on the landing, drooling away while watching our noisy lovemaking. Now, outside and wearing my stupid jeans tucked into the tops of the stupid boots, and feeling like some stupid zombie catalogue poser, I'm looking back down the street and examining the densely packed undead babies all staring forward at me and Marcy. The whole of the street is crammed with them, from one side to the other, and back as far as I can see, there are dead faces drooling and staring with red bloodshot eyes. The connection is strong, I suddenly stride forward marching at them. They obey to the will of my mind instantly and scuttle back to form a narrow path down the middle. Within a couple of seconds, they're standing to attention in neat lines, perfectly spaced and staring dead ahead like the lovely little soldiers they are. Marcy and I walk down the middle, examining them and noting the ones with the worst injuries. They can go in the first wave, We'll keep the stronger ones back, Marcy says, and I send the instruction out through the hundreds of strands of telepathic connectors that entwine us all, instructing and marking them as first group or second. Actually, Marcy pauses, we'll do it in stages and send in the most injured first, then the next lot with not so bad injuries, then the ones with slight injuries, and the strongest, healthiest and freshest will keep with us until the end. No point in wasting the good ones at the start. We'll let the weaker ones break down their defences and learn where the weak links are. But I've already started telling them to go in two stages. Then we'll go back to the beginning and start again. She smiles about turns and starts wiggling her naked behind back to the end of the line. Grumbling and muttering to myself, I follow her and watch as she starts examining them again, but closer this time. Can you make them present their injuries so we don't have to keep looking for them? For fuck's sake, this is fucking stupid. The poor cunts shouldn't have to stand there parading their wounds. Darren, just do it, please, she snaps. The zombies are a sudden hive of activity as they shuffle and twist round, bending, kneeling, lifting tops up or dropping trousers to show their cuts, bites, lacerations and gouges. That's better, thank you. Now how about we number them into groups, say four groups. I'll give them a number, and do you tell them what group they're in? This isn't a fucking school sports day, Marcy. Are the men and women of the same strength and ferocity? She ignores my sarcasm. Yep, pretty much. The bigger ones move a bit slower, but obviously their extra weight helps them at the end. Also, moving them too fast in the daytime weakens them. By how much? Depends. If they've been dead a while, then they'll weaken faster because of the rate of decomposition they've already suffered. The fresher ones should last longer. We shall move them at a steady pace and keep them conserved until we need them to start shifting. Right, I'll count out and you tell them what group they're in. 
This is fucking stupid. Why don't we just go now and rip Howie's fucking face off? We got loads, and most of them are fresh. Did that work last time, Darren? No, so please just do as I ask. Fine. One, four, three, four. Slow down, I can't keep up. Darren, this isn't rocket science. Just slow down. Where did you get to? I don't know. Start again. Darren! Sorry, love, but you went too fast. Just do it slower. One. Got it? Yes. Four. Got it? Don't take the piss. Well, apparently you couldn't keep up a minute ago. Just fucking count them out. I shout in anger. She flashes a mean look at me before turning away dramatically and reeling the numbers off. Following behind her, I send the messages as we go and let them stand easy once they've been checked and counted. The poor things shuffle and relax behind us as we work our way down the long lines, with Marcy examining wounds like some field doctor and shouting numbers out. Oh, what about this one? she asks after a few minutes. He's only got one arm, Marcy. Yeah, I know, but he looks strong and healthy enough. Yeah, for a one-armed zombie. We'll put him in the third group. I think he'll do well. The third? Are you joking? He needs to go in one or two. But look at the muscles in his good arm. What do you mean his good arm? He doesn't have a good arm. He has one arm. Stop being pedantic, Darren. Three, please. OK. Telepathically, I tell him he's a two and hope Marcy doesn't notice later. I'll just blame it on the confusion of battle. We keep going down the lines, reaching a junction and sweeping round to the left, and even I'm surprised at how many we've taken in just one day. Standing on the junction, I look up, then off to the left, and the sheer sight of the hundreds and hundreds of zombies makes me grin like the demented super zombie I am. Fuck you, Dave, you cunt runt. Try swinging your pen knives at this lot and see where it gets you. Mind you, he is good, though. The nasty little prick is too good, really. I fucking hate the way he leaps about like some fucked-up ballet dancer. What fucking right has he got to be that good? It isn't fucking fair that he's on their side. Why can't we have a Dave on our side? Fuck it. I'll just send all of them after Dave and get him turned. Ha! <laughs> How he would be royally fucked up the arse, then, if we sent zombie Dave after him but then Dave would see it coming and probably stab himself in the brain to make sure he wouldn't come back. Fucking stupid cunt run stabbing himself in the brain. That's not fucking fair. It's fucking cheating is what it is. Darren! What? You're ranting. Oh, am I? Sorry. Just thinking about Dave stabbing himself in the brain. What? Why would he do that? Because he's a prize cunt is why. It's the sort of stupid, cheating, fucked-up thing he would do, just so he wouldn't have to go after his fucking limp-wristed, cock-sucking boyfriend, Howie. Darren! What? You're ranting again. Can we just get on with it? And don't be homophobic. What? I don't like it. My brother was gay. Marcy, if you saw your brother standing there now, you would eat his brains. That's not the point. Don't use gay things in your ranting. How about racism? Can I use that? No. Oh, so just generalised, non-specific, abusive ranting then. Four, two, two, one. She presses on before I start off on one again. How about people with learning difficulties? Can I take the piss out of them? No. My cousin was in a wheelchair. Three. Two, four. That's disabled, not learning difficulties. Well, he was a bit retarded too. Three, one, one. You can't say retarded anymore. What? Who said so? If I can't call Howie a gay cunt, then you can't call people retards. Fine. One, one, one. And there's a lot of ones here. They're not ours, Marcy. They were already turned and I've got no connection to them. Oh, that's a shame. He wasn't really retarded. He was just a bit thick, really. Three, two... 
If you saw a person with learning difficulties, would you bite them? Darren, we have spent the day slaughtering every living person we've come across, and a few of them did have learning difficulties. Did they? I didn't notice any. They were killed before you got there. You just sucked on them a bit. I didn't notice any difference in the taste. One, three, three, two. Seven. We head back down the narrow path, trudging through the shaded trees and back out beside the high wall that looks out along the sweep of the bay towards the town. Clarence, Dave, Blowers, Nick, Cookie and I, along with Stephen and Tom. Leaving was hard on all of us, not just our group, but the people left behind again. We had more arguments from Sarah and Terry, which at one point threatened to spiral out of control until Ted and Sergeant Hopewell stepped in, using their vast policing experience to calm everyone down. Thankfully, Stephen and Tom had the sense to stay quiet and not get drawn in. I think they were worried that if they got involved, they could end up staying and miss the opportunity to come with us. Personally, if I was in their shoes, I would have jumped at the chance of staying in the relative safety of the bunkers while some crazy idiots went off to charge a load of frenzied undead, especially with nightfall only a couple of hours away. But then that's wrong because I could stay there if I wanted to. Any of us could. We could easily argue that we've done enough and just refuse to leave. I'm not sure that if it came to it, we would be forced out at gunpoint. We have weapons too and everyone in there could see we're experienced with them. So no, I wouldn't have stayed if I was in their shoes. I haven't stayed since this thing began. Some of Sarah's words resonate through my mind as we walk in silence. She said again that we're getting addicted to it, that the killing is something we enjoy instead of it being a necessity only to be done when absolutely necessary. I could tell that comment made us all feel a little uncomfortable, and maybe there is some truth in it. If we thought it through and really contemplated it seriously, we could probably come up with another way of leaving without having to fight. We could have considered taking our group further along the coast until we found another harbour with boats. This island must have loads of harbours. With the retired Navy captain with us, we could have probably made our way to one of the commercial ports that the tourist ferries use and taken everyone away together. So why choose this option then? Glancing round... I can see that all of us, apart from Stephen and Tom, have serious intent expressions. We know what is coming and how truly awful it will be. We know that the simplest of mistakes could mean the death of us all. No machine guns, no safety of the Saxon APC, and with two new untrained and inexperienced fighters, we are virtually offering ourselves as a sacrifice. Terry said as much in her final attempt at getting us to change our minds and either stay or take them with us. But it isn't that. It is something else. Our race has been challenged, and as a result we have seen our families, friends and comrades die horrible, brutal and violent deaths. Something in us will simply not accept that. It's wrong and it has to be challenged because the consequences are simply too utterly terrifying to contemplate. Bad things happen when good people stand by and do nothing. Darren was one of us, and it's almost as though he chose to be on their side. He could have gone off somewhere else and been a zombie. He didn't have to come after us the way he did, and he willfully took the lives of our loved ones. Sarah is close when she says it's an addiction we've got used to. It isn't that. It's the chance to take back what is ours by right of virtue. It's the chance to make a decision as free men and see it through. To show them we will not cower and hide. And maybe a small part of it is the prospect of battle, standing in line next to your mate and culling the evil spawn of the devil centred us. Virtuous. Glorious. Righteous. In the end, it was Clarence and Dave that gave their pistols up to Tom and Stephen, taking them aside for a few minutes and drilling them with dry firing, reloading and more dry firing. Again, I was surprised at how the two lads responded seriously and didn't piss about and squabble like they do most of the time. But then I caught Ted glaring at them 
and figured he'd had a quiet and most likely very threatening word with them to behave. They looked the part now, with similar backpacks strapped on and sawn-off shotguns wedged in so the stocks poke out. Pistols are strapped on the police utility belts they still wear, and I notice that Tom still carries his taser and extendable baton. Dave even managed to find them an axe each, not as large as the ones we looted from the DIY store, but more like the first one I started out with. They just don't look hardened like the other lads. There is fear and nervous energy in their faces. Not just fear of what's coming, but also that they don't look stupid in front of the rest of us. Lads, listen up. If and when it starts getting horrible, I want you to split up and stick with Clarence and Dave. Keep your ears open and listen for the instructions given. Not just from me, but from all of us. Clarence and Dave are both extremely experienced, so don't try and copy them or do what they do. Do not overextend or allow yourselves to get isolated or trapped. Aim for the head and keep moving. The shotguns have incredible firepower, but the range is shit. Remember that. What do we do if we get trapped or surrounded? Tom asks. Fight like bastards, Blowers replies quickly. They both grin at the quick answer, but the smiles soon vanish when they see he's not joking. Is that Larney? Nick cuts in, pointing across to a wooden bench set against the wall, where a small figure sits watching the sea. A backpack rests by her feet, and a huge meat cleaver is across her lap. She turns her head to watch us approaching. Her face stays impassive and expressionless. Lani? I nod as we gather round the bench. Mr Howie? She nods back and stares at me defiantly. Why are you out here? I am coming with you. She stands quickly and starts shrugging the backpack on. Still got my gun then. I notice the stock poking out the top of the bag. Nope, I got another one. I put yours back in your bag. Nice meat cleaver, Lani, Nick grins, genuinely pleased to see her again. Lani, Mr Howie, she cuts me off. I'm coming with you. It's my family out there. It's those zombies that took my family, friends, and everyone I've ever known or cared about. This is my choice. I waited here for you so it didn't make it awkward for you in there. She nods back towards the fort. But this is my choice. My decision. She reaches down to pick the meat cleaver up from the bench and stands ready and waiting. Looking down, I see she's even found a pair of boots instead of the trainers she was wearing before. Lani, please go back and wait with the others. No, I'm coming with you. I've killed a few of them, and I survived for nine days on my own, so I've earned my place. I know you did, Lani, but I'd still rather you waited here. Why, because I'm a girl? No, it's not that. Mr. Howie, I'm not going back. I respect you're in charge and I will follow your orders exactly. I won't slow you down or get in the way and this is the only time I'll be rude to you. But with all due respect, sir, you can fuck off if you think you can make me stay. The way she says it, so polite yet firm, makes me burst out laughing. Not in a take the piss kind of way and she can see I'm not patronising her. She just won the point and she knows it. Glancing round with a wry smile and a glint in her eye that reminds me of Dave. Bloody hell, are you two related by any chance? Looking between them both, I shake my head at the similarities. No, Mr Howie, I think Lani is from Thailand, Dave replies seriously. Right, well, let's get going then. I sigh at the sheer absurdity of it and hear Nick give an audible, yes which gets quick glances from the rest of us. With Nick looking sheepish, we move out, and on this ninth day, we become nine. Nine bloody idiots going out to pick a fight with a dirty bunch of infected zombies. Still, at least it's not raining. Eight. What's it called again? Puck pool, she answers. That's a stupid fucking name for a place. You think that's where they've gone? It's the only place round here that could hold that many people. We'll try there first, she says, and having clearly made the decision of where we're going, 
she strides on. Marcy also decided that it wasn't appropriate to go into battle naked. I argued this by saying that it might distract some of the young lads if she comes charging at them with her boobs bouncing about all over the place. I got a funny look for that comment and she asked me if I thought her boobs were saggy then. I said no, of course I didn't think that, but any woman's boobs would bounce if she ran about naked. Dressed to kill, I'm still wearing the fucking awful jeans and boots. She noticed that I pulled the bottoms of the jeans out from the boots and refused to walk anywhere until I'd tucked them back in. In just this one day, I've learnt that doing what Marcy wants makes my undead life a lot easier. She's very bossy, but then she does keep reminding me of how I screwed up before when I had tens of thousands of zombies with me, and anyone that can fuck something like that up needs to be told what to do. I never really had a girlfriend before. In the previous life, I was just a lazy twat that smoked too much dope and hung around on the streets doing fuck all. That and playing Xbox was pretty much all I did. Then they told me I had to join the Territorial Army to get my benefit money. Stupid fuckers should have left me at home smoking weed and playing Call of Duty. So I've never really had a girlfriend before or even that much to do with women. So I don't know if they're all this bossy and demanding. But she's very pretty and she seems to know what she's doing. So it's easier just to go along with it. And a super zombie should have a good woman with him. Finally... She was ready, after pissing about making sure her clothes were right and her hair was brushed and the blood was washed from her face. Then she put a little bit of makeup on while me and the horde stood about making small talk. Well, I made small talk and they just listened mostly, with the odd sympathetic groan here and there. When she came out of the house she was using, I had my babies doing some warm-up exercises, stretching their arms back and forth and a bit of light jogging on the spot. They were already formed up in their four groups, so the ones nearest to me were the worst of the bunch, with ragged injuries and limbs hanging off. The ones that hadn't been turned by me were just standing there, staring dumbly, with drool pouring out of their mouths. Marcy led us through the streets, going pretty much back the way we came, all the better to admire the trail of destruction we'd left behind us. Doors hanging open, Windows smashed in, blood smears and trails everywhere, and the odd corpse of those that had been too heavily injured or eaten by the horde. As we neared the seafront, I could smell the blazing buildings long before they came into sight, and turning the last corner before the esplanade, I looked back with sheer joy at the huge roaring fire spread along the whole row of buildings, from the hotel through to the last house. Long orange flames licked up at the sky as thick black clouds rolled and boiled around them. Now with the blaze behind us, we set off on the road parallel to the sweeping bay, heading towards Howie and his little piggy fucktards. 9. Lani, once we make contact, we need to lead them inland and away from here. I dropped back a few steps with Dave and Clarence to speak with our local expert. We need somewhere we can use for the night, Clarence adds. Somewhere defensible. What, like a house or something? Lani asks. Too many points of entry in a house, Dave says. We want to funnel them so they can't all attack at the same time. But with an escape route in case we have to give ground, Clarence adds. You don't want much then? She looks thoughtfully ahead. There's a big church at the top of the town. It's got a main entrance with double doors and a big porch that sticks out. A recess door? How big is the recess? Dave asks. I don't know, she answers with a shake of her head. Roughly how many people could fit in it? About ten in a line from front to back if they were squashed up. Other doors? Dave probes. There's a back entrance that goes into an annex. They use it for first aid training and that kind of thing. There's a door that leads from the annex into the church, but it's really old and solid. Single or double-sized, Dave continues. Um, it's only a single door. What about the windows? They're glass, but they're quite high up and narrow. It's got a big spire that people can go up to look down at the town. That would be perfect if we had rifles instead of shotguns, 
Are there any gunsmiths in the town? I ask her. Any what? She asks. Gunsmiths. Shops that sell guns. No, only in the main town, about ten miles away. So it's got a main recessed entrance and the rear door. Any other exits? I ask. There might be, but I only know those two. A church has thick walls, and it would funnel them with a deep porch. But if there's only two exits, we could get trapped, Clarence says. But with that tower Lani mentioned, we could go up that and hold them off easily. That will only have a single access point or stairs that could be defended. It's a strong contender. What other places are there? I ask again, and watch Alani as she looks out to the distance in contemplation. The pier? She points across the bay to the long black pier jutting out into the blue water. That's long and thin with only one way up it. How wide is it? Dave asks. Uh, maybe two car widths or a bit more than that? I know two cars can pass each other on the way up. That's quite wide. It will be hard to defend, but we'll keep it in mind. I think we should aim for the church, unless we find something else on the way, or Lani thinks of any other places. They nod back as I glance round to make sure everyone heard the plan, and we keep going. In the distance, we can see the huge plumes of thick black smoke high in the air, and I get a visual image of Chris standing at the back of the fort, looking over the sea, and watching the smoke with a small, wry smile, wondering what devastation we're wreaking over here. None of us has eaten properly or slept for a long time, getting by on adrenaline and adventure. The threat of death has kept us alert and ready, but this can't be sustained. At some point we need to stop, rest, eat, sleep, but right now I can't think when that will be. Every time we think we've reached our objective, things change and fuck up. We had to fight to get the Saxon, then fight to reach the hospital and Sarah, then we were fighting all the way back down, thinking we'll be safe at the forts, only to face another massive battle. Each time we keep thinking this will be it. This will be the final act and we can rest, but as with everything else, since this terrible event started, it's all gone to rat shit. Even now, marching out, we're thinking we'll lure Darren away and get our people back to our fort, and then it'll be over. But it won't. It'll never be over. We need to evolve the same way Darren is. All the way the infection keeps changing. Something inside me screams that we need to attack and drive them down, press the attack and keep going no matter what happens. Lure them away, fight, run, fight and all the time cull their numbers. Only by killing every last one of them can we ever hope to live in peace. Darren won't stop until he turns every last one of us. He has to die, and die properly this time. 10. Howie is a cunt. A dirty, cunning bastard. As long as he is alive, he will inspire all the other hero wannabes that they can fight and kill us. Instead of hiding away and being easy prey for us to come along and chomp on them, they'll get all tough with nasty gleams in their eyes. And instead of standing there pissing themselves and shaking like leaves, holding little kitchen knives... They'll be going into their garages and sheds looking for big, heavy, sharp things, making weapons and learning how to use bows and arrows. I could arm my babies and give them all knives, but the stupid buggers would probably just stab themselves or each other when they got all frenzied and worked up. And there's no way I can control so many individuals if they're using hand weapons. I can lead them, show them which way to go and even control a few during a scrap, but that's about it. The control I have is strong, but not that good. So before Howie and his cunt run, Dave can start leading some kind of do-gooding resistance movement, he has to die. He has to die painfully and slowly. An awful death that makes him scream and beg, and when he turns, I'll send him back to them, so they have to kill him again. That will take the fight out of them. It will send a message to leave us alone and let us live in peace. We need to feed just the same as them, and we've as much right as they do to go after our food source. Just because it happens to be them we need to eat to survive is not our fault. That's nature. Lions and wolves aren't evil, they kill to survive. They take what they need to ensure the survival of their species. Same as us. This has to end, and how he must die before he becomes a folk hero cunt with songs sung about him. 
Poems and stories whispered at night to small children about how they need to eat their vegetables and sleep well so they can grow big and strong and become like Howie, the hero of the people. Fuck him. Fuck Dave and fuck Howie and fuck all their little piggy fucktard twats. 11. Contact Mr Howie, straight ahead of us on the road. Dave shades his eyes to stare off into the distance. Copying his actions, I strain and squint until tears start filling my eyes. But I can't see anything. Just the beach. The sea, the woods to one side, and the road ahead of us stretching for miles. Yeah, I can see them, Blowers says. In the distance, there's a thick black line of them. They almost look part of the road, Mr Howie. I relax my gaze and stare at the road ahead of us, letting my eyes sweep along the concrete, taking in all the details and colours until there in the far distance I see a black smudge that becomes clearer as my mind works to process the images. The smudge is moving, a snake slithering across the road, long, dark and gently undulating. There must be hundreds. I can already feel my heart beating faster at the sight of them. They're earlier than expected. We thought we'd be able to get into the town and find them before they started coming for us. The fact that they're heading in this direction means they've worked out where our group could be hiding. There's a lane at the side of the cafe, Mr Howie, where we found the van earlier to pull the shutters off. We can lead them up that lane and away from here, Lani suggests urgently. Looking down the path, I can see the cafe. Then I look further up at the black mass of undead, then back down to the cafe. Speed up. I give the simple order and start a gentle jog. We need to make that cafe well before they get close. We need a chance for them to see us, start coming, and then leg it away. Checking round me, I see the others are moving faster now, and thankfully they've sorted their bags well enough that nothing falls out or comes loose. Waiting a couple of minutes for stiff muscles to warm up, I gradually increase the pace. Still jogging, but getting faster and ensuring we get to that cafe. 12. I spy with my zombie eye something beginning with C. C? Marcy asks, a puzzled expression on her face. Cunts. I nod forward and point to the distance. Can you see them? She says excitedly, staring off and scanning the bay, beach, sea, everywhere but the bloody path in front of her. See them? I can smell the nasty little wankers. Really? She sniffs the air in front of her. Not literally, Marcy. Well, don't say it then if you can't actually smell them. Is that them? She points to the distant figures. Yep, I'd recognise his gay run anywhere. Darren, what did I say about using gay insults? Sorry, Marcy. Thank you. They're coming straight at us. We should speed up she says. No, don't waste energy. They're coming this way, so let them get closer before we do anything. I can feel his blood in my mouth. I can taste it. I can taste how he's death. He's close. So is Dave. My undead zombie heart kicks up a notch, and despite what I just said, I can't help but start moving faster. 13. Quicker! Muscles warmed up and lungs starting to work harder, we increase our pace and keep watch between the cafe and the thick mass coming towards us. Everyone okay? I call out, mainly for the benefit of the new arrivals, but I get a round-robin chorus of replies. Eyes now locked on the horde, I can see Darren has been busy killing and gathering more undead to join his evil quest. There are hundreds of them, all moving as one and keeping steady with their leader. Getting closer, I can see two distinct figures out front. One of them must be Darren, but I have no idea who the other is, or how his vanity would allow someone else to walk out in front with him. Our two groups, so vastly different in size, edge closer and closer. The gap shrinks with every step we take, and every one of those steps brings us closer to the real and serious risk of dying a horrible, tortured death at the hands and mouths of those evil spawn. With the cafe in full view now, we keep running and see there is a safe length of distance between us and them, and thankfully, the horde have not started running at us yet. 
He's learning, Dave says. He is, mate. Keeping them full of energy so we can have a good scrap. Hear that, lads? Darren is keeping them all safe and together. He's learning. He's getting better. Fuck him, Mr. Howie, Blower snorts. We'll still win, Nick adds, and I hear the hard tones in their voices. The bitterness and the rage is there, ready to be focused and used. I fucking love this, Cookie suddenly spits out, making the rest of us laugh. Why don't we just fucking charge him and get at it? Stupidly, amazingly and without doubt, his suggestion gains a second or two of serious thought. Well, I know I give it serious thought and something hangs in the air that suggests Dave, Clarence and the other two lads are too. Not so sure about Tom, Stephen and Larney though. I never told you this before, Clarence, but uh, Darren once said you were fat and ugly. Cookie continues the jokes, his way of dealing with the impending fight. Did he now? Clarence growls. Do you think they've seen us? Stephen asks. Despite his nervous question, his voice sounds steady enough. I reckon so, mate. My voice comes out low and gets a quick glance from Dave jogging at my side. He gives a small, rare smile, and I can see the gleam in his eyes. Nick, get in the cafe and drag out the gas bottles from that barbecue, Dave orders as we reach the front of the building. The horde is several hundred metres away and still moving at the same steady pace, but the sheer size of the zombie army coming at us makes it feel as if they are closer. We pause, chests rising and falling as we get our breathing back under control. Nick darts in, reappearing with a gas bottle in each hand. Dave takes one from Nick and takes the pistol from Nick's belt all in one smooth move. He hands the gas bottle to Clarence and nods at the approaching horde. Clarence looks down at the gas bottle, takes it and weighs it in his hand for a second while looking at the zombies. With a nod at Dave, he turns to face them. No fucking way, Cookie mutters. They're too far away. Yeah, watch this. Ready, Dave? Clarence says quietly. Ready? Dave slides the top of the pistol back and stands with it held in a two-handed grip down in front of him. Clarence swings the gas bottle back and forth a few times before spinning round and forward and sending it soaring into the sky. Dave's reaction is instant. The pistol is raised and tracks the bottle as it sails slowly end over end towards the horde. The rest of us watch with bated breath as the bottle arcs up, then starts coming down to earth, clearing the front of the horde and dropping down deep within the ranks. Two loud retorts sound out. One from the single shot Dave fires, and a split second later from the gas bottle as it explodes. The pressure wave sends the packed ranks spewing out in all directions, lacerated by scorching hot fragments of the gas bottle and burnt from the ignition of the gas contained within. Cheers erupt as Clarence is handed the second bottle. He nods at Dave, then spins round and forward again. As he releases the bottle, he roars out in animalistic rage and the gas bottle flies higher and goes further than the previous one. Dave tracks the bottle and again fires at the very last second, as it drops to within a few feet of the horde. With a huge explosion, the bottle bursts into a ball of flame, eliciting another eruption of cheers from us. Fuck it, that's got them going, I say as the horde starts running towards us and I just catch a glimpse of some of them stumbling over the bodies of their fallen comrades in death. Get going! There's no need to give that order because we're off, jogging up the side of the cafe on the narrow road which starts off as a gentle slope but soon becomes a steep incline and within a couple of minutes I can feel my thigh starting to burn from the exertion. Shitting hell! Nick groans with the same discomfort. Stop moaning, it's only a small hill! Lani smiles at the lads, looking fresh and unflustered. She strides easily and clearly has a level of fitness like Dave, who is also powering up without issue. The incline increases, and the hill seems to go on forever, draining our legs and sapping vital energy. Glancing back, I can see the front of the horde are nearly at the cafe with Darren, and what looks like a beautiful woman out front. Darren's got a girlfriend, I pant with ragged breath. Has he? Blowers, Nick and Cookie all twist round to look. She looks crumpet, Blowers smirks. Fuck you, Smithy, Cookie bellows as he sticks two fingers up. Blowers and Nick repeat the act, and I turn back to see Darren running with one hand up, extending his middle finger in our direction. 
Does this hill ever end? Nick grumbles again after a few more seconds of constant running. Not far, Lani replies. We trudge up, one foot in front of the other, chests heaving and muscles straining with exertion. None of us slow down, though. If we stop now, we won't be able to get going again. Dig in, Clarence encourages the others, desperately willing them on despite the pain and agony. Keep going. Not far now. I can see he is suffering. Maybe more than us, as his thigh muscles are massive, and a man of his size is not designed for rapid stamina work like this. Groans, growls and moans sound out between us as the bastard hill just keeps going. Don't worry about them. Clarence catches Stephen glancing round, his face red and sweating freely. Just keep moving. Give it here. Dave drops back to take the axe from Nick, who is clearly struggling, and I watch Lani discreetly moving to take the same from Cookie. He gives it up with barely a response. Dave and Lani run easily, each holding two heavy hand weapons while the rest of us feel the vomit rising in our stomachs and throats. Almost there! Lani points up ahead with the giant meat cleaver which barely trembles in her grasp. Dave glances across at Lani, and he looks as devoid of expression as normal. I can tell from the constant time we've spent in each other's company that he's impressed. The hill continues to rise as the car park they took the van from drops further and further behind. If Lani thinks we can make it to the top, she must be crazy. Then I see it. A small entrance on the right leading into a narrow lane. The sight of the lane gives us a final burst of speed, and we reach it with our lungs gasping for more air and our legs feeling like lead. Turning into the lane, I notice it's bordered on one side by a thicket of dense trees and on the other by a high wire fence. The sudden relief of not having to power against gravity is amazing, and we half run, half hobble into the lane that's only wide enough for two abreast. I drop back with Dave and Clarence and urge the rest past me, eventually bringing up the rear with Clarence at my side and Dave behind us. The lane twists through the trees, following the high wire fence that soon gives way to a high brick wall. Here! Lani shouts and stops, pointing up at the wall. Go over here! Why? I shout from the back. The wall has broken glass all along the top apart from this bit here. We can go through the grounds of the nunnery and come out further along. Do it! Quick! Get over! I shout forward and watch Clarence push the rest out of the way to reach the front. Dropping his axe, he grasps Lani round the waist and launches her onto the top of the wall with ease before twisting round to grab and hoist the next one up. With Clarence throwing people, the lads scrabbling up and Dave leaping like a gazelle, we get over the wall and slump down, getting our breath for a few seconds. Shotguns! Get them ready! I gasp and stagger backwards a few steps to make sure the horde can see us through the wire fencing. I reach back and draw mine out as the front of the horde comes into view. They're undead zombies, but even they are blowing out their asses at having to charge up that bloody hill. Darren and the woman are out in front. He slows down, and we lock eyes for a few seconds. On seeing me, he surges forward, only to be grabbed and pulled back by the woman. He turns and says something to her, but she yells and pulls him back just as the hordes surge past him, giving safety to them with their bodies. You look like a twat in those jeans, Darren! Cookie bellows to sniggers from Nick and Blowers. Tom and Stephen exchange nervous glances as they hold their shotguns ready. Fuck you, Cookie! I'm gonna eat your fucking face off! Darren screams out from somewhere in the midst of his horde, who are all trying to squeeze down the narrow lane. That woman's fit, Darren! What's she doing with you? Blowers yells out. Send her over first! She looks nice! Get a few now! I step towards the fence and fire both barrels into the densely packed horde the other side. Loud metallic twangs sound out as the pellets strike the fence, but the damage to the zombies is awesome. A second or two later, and eight more shotguns fire two barrels each, and we watch with unabated glee as they start dropping from the fire. Coming over! Dave shouts a warning as the first of the horde gains the top of the wall and drops down on our side. Lani darts forward almost as quick as Dave, and I watch Dave hold back at the last second and let Lani swing the cleaver round, taking the zombie's head clean off its shoulders. Reloaded, we fire again into the horde as Dave yells to start moving back. The zombies spread further down the wall, climbing onto the broken glass and dropping down with blood pumping from fresh cuts and fingers hanging off from the sharp shards. 
Dropping back steadily, we reload and help each other to shove the shotguns back into bags, and I quickly glimpse the flush of excitement on Tom and Stephen's faces from what could be their first kills. The grounds slope down to a large detached house, and we start jogging to gain distance as the undead breach the walls en masse. The wire fencing begins to buckle as the hordes start powering against it in a synchronised effort that must be the work of Darren controlling them. Fuck it, it's a zombie nun! Cookie yells out with alarm. A black and white robed figure staggers into view from the side of the building. More follow until there's a line of black and white penguin-like zombie nuns. I'm not killing a nun, Blowers shouts. It's not a nun, I shout back. Sorry, Mr. Howie, but I can't kill a nun. This way, Lani steers us off to the left away from the undead nuns, weaving through a collection of outbuildings and down a driveway to a set of gates that hang open. Large dried stains of blood spatter the ground, smearing the approach to the big house. Don't take us back up the hill, Nick pleads as we burst out into a quiet residential street to see the same evil incline rising off to the left. Okay, just for you. With a smile, Lani leads us down the hill and cuts down an alley at the side of another big house. We run through perfectly manicured lawns and trample flower beds as we climb low fences and break through to a main road, again on a bloody great big hill and facing more large Victorian houses. Every bloody street looks the same in this shitty town, Blowers growls looking up and down the hill. Thankfully, Lani leads us down the hill this time, back towards the seafront, having taken us in a big loop. Still jogging, but with a steadier pace, we're all sweating and flushed, apart from the two weird fitness freaks among us. As we near a junction at the bottom of the road, the hordes start bursting out of the gardens we've just come through, staggering into the road and hardly breaking stride as they continue their hunting. Oh my god, Mr Howie! Cookie yells out, standing still with a terrified expression on his face. He puts his fist to his mouth and turns back quickly to glance at the horde coming after us. I think we're being chased by zombies! The stance he adopts with the mock expression of terror sets us off and we burst out laughing. Grinning like an idiot, Cookie starts jogging again. Knackered, breathing hard, sweating, armed to the teeth and being chased by several hundred zombie creatures, we crack up laughing as we run. Giggles of mirth sound out and I know it's just the nervous excitement manifesting, but it still feels good to be laughing. A little surreal, but good. Turning into the junction, Lani continues to lead us down quiet side streets, and it's not long before we start to see signs of the devastation that Darren has wrought, bringing our laughing and frivolity to an abrupt end, and reminding us of how much death and suffering must have taken place just hours before. Windows and doors smashed, bodies strewn everywhere. Some are old and already decomposing, festering in the hot summer sun and writhing with the bloated fat white bodies of maggots. Some are fresh kills, still with glistening injuries that hardly look human due to the amount of flesh eaten away. Entrails, organs and limbs have been hacked apart. The sour metallic tang of filth, blood and rancid half-cooked meat fills the air, mixing with the smoky scent from the fires still raging nearby, like the aftermath of some macabre barbecue. Our pace stays steady. We keep the horde a few hundred metres behind us, and I only wish we had greater firepower to whittle them down as we run. The Saxon and the GPMG would make short work of this bunch, and it makes me think that without weapons like that and the people that know how to utilise them, this ongoing battle could be long and drawn out if we're reduced to using things like shotguns and axes. Breathing gets harder, and the dull aches in our legs spread as we power on. Dave orders everyone to draw water from their bags and to sip it down as we jog, but not to gulp it too quickly. Helping each other, we take the bottles out, squirting the gloriously cool liquid onto our faces to rinse the stinging sweat from our eyes. Even Lani is starting to look a little red in the cheeks, and her beautiful silky black hair starts to stick to her glistening forehead. Tom and Stephen both keep pace and look neither fresher nor more knackered than the rest. We have to go back uphill, but we can stagger it using side streets, Lani says, her voice still strong and confident. She jogs just ahead of me, and I watch her lithe, athletic body running with so much grace she's like water running down a stream. Each movement is precise, but relaxed, 
No energy wasted. Her arms stay relatively still and don't pump away. Her head stays relaxed and sways gently as she bobs along. Her feet come up enough to propel her along and no more. So much like Dave. And I wonder how people are made so differently. Clarence, with his enormous strength and huge heart, must be suffering more than any of us having to carry his weight along. He doesn't moan once, and I know that so many years in the forces must have left him with more stamina than a big guy like him would normally have. His face is set, serious and focused. All our faces are as we start to climb another hill and have to internally change to a lower gear to keep the momentum going. Keep going, it's not far. Lani urges us on, dropping back and speaking in low tones to some of the lads, offering to take their axes, but I see their stubborn pride showing, and they refuse. Go right, Mr Howie. Lani points to another junction further up the hill, and again we dig in and drive on, desperate to reach the flat street. As we turn, I feel a sense of victory. The worst of the pain eases off as the ground levels out, and I call out, encouraging everyone to keep moving and not slow down. They've gained a little distance, Dave says, loud enough for us all to hear. Don't speed up, lads. Keep this pace, Dave adds at the burst of power applied at his bad news, sounding more like a drill sergeant than ever before. More houses with shattered doors. More broken windows. More blood. More devastation as we go deeper into this town following the route that Darren took on his quest for food. Our lives are so entwined now, and I can sense him behind us. The infection or disease or whatever dirty thing that his filthy heart pumps round his body driving him on, making him think and believe that killing us is the answer to every problem he'll ever have. He must realise that this is futile, that by killing and turning everyone, he is eradicating his own food source, which only serves to give him a finite existence. Church or pier, Mr Howie? Lani asks, breaking into my morbid thoughts. Church, Lani. Please send us downhill, Nick groans. Left and uphill again, but only for a minute or two. Lani turns and gives the struggling lad a huge, gorgeous smile, and I know it's just what he needs and must be making him feel like he's floating on air. Dig in, Clarence roars as we surge into yet another junction and turn to start working up the incline again. Growls come from blowers as he lets some rage into his system. Tom looks tougher already, and I can see Stephen is struggling but determined. Nick worries me, though. I can see he is really struggling to keep up with the relentless pace. Give me your axe. I drop back and hold my arm out. I'm okay, Mr Howie, he pants. Now, Nick, I insist. A harder tone to my voice and he hands it over without question. Dave drops behind him and starts tugging his rucksack off, telling him to drop his arms down. I'm okay, Nick protests again, but is not left with any choice as Dave pulls the bag off and carries it one-handed. Clarence drops back too, raises his water bottle over Nick's head, upends it and pours the cool liquid over his face. Keep going, Nick, you're doing well. For once, Dave doesn't rely on fear, but adopts a softer tone, urging him on. Go right, Lani yells as we gain the next junction, and I could kiss her for staggering the run like this instead of just assuming we could keep up with her and run straight up this hill. Cookie starts to flag next. He reaches the junction and starts well on the flat, level ground, but it's not long before I see his face grow pale with exhaustion and his steps begin to falter. Clarence notices too and drops back to grab his wrist and pull him on, yelling for someone to give him some water. They're gaining! Dave keeps his voice calm but alerts us once more to the horde behind. We can stay flat for a while now. Lani keeps us going along one wide avenue until we reach a crossroads. The hotel we used the night before is just down to the left with the seafront further down the hill, providing a dazzling blue backdrop to the huge fire still raging away. We go over the crossroads and into the main town area, running past deserted shops and seeing more carnage from the night before. Decaying bodies and dried bloodstains are everywhere. Dave runs to Lani and hands her Nick's bag, then sprints off ahead, disappearing into a shop doorway. Loud smashing sounds follow, and within a few seconds, he sprints back out, carrying armfuls of LucasAid sports drinks. He runs back and hands them round to ragged thanks and grunts of approval. 
The flat isotonic drink pumps welcome glucose into our systems. The risk of cramp is high, but we need an instant energy fix more than anything or we'll grind to a halt. Tom, Stephen and Lani aren't suffering the same as the rest of us. But then we've been solidly at it for the full nine days so far. Bad rest periods, sporadic food and constant movement has worn us down. The drinks work, revitalising us within seconds and giving us just that extra bit of energy to keep our legs moving one foot in front of the other. That and the flat ground helps us push on. My legs feel like rubber, weak and shaky. My chest is heaving and I can feel a dull ache in the back of my head. The drink is downed within seconds and I can taste the syrup on my tongue and lips. Dave sprints off ahead again, and this time he powers into the main doors of a large bar which already looks wrecked and destroyed with all the windows smashed and bits of furniture strewn about. He's gone longer this time, and comes out just as we draw even with the building. Instead of carrying refreshing drinks, he's got armfuls of spirit bottles, each one with the top unscrewed and a torn piece of rag hanging from the neck. He drops down and uses a lighter to ignite the rags. Keep going! He yells as we stop to help. His powerful voice repels us away and we do as we're told, jogging on as he picks the first bottle up and sends it high into the air. Two more are thrown before the first one impacts with a shattering whoosh and I glance back to see the liquid igniting into a thick pool of flame. Dave spot throws the bottles and creates a line of fire across the road before jogging back to us and taking Nick's bag from Lani. Good thinking, mate. I pant the words out between breaths, vowing never to smoke another cigarette again. The flames won't slow them, but it will hurt a few and maybe ignite some clothes in their densely packed ranks. Through the town centre, and we jog round to the left and up through the high street. Again, it starts off as a gentle incline, but rapidly gets steeper until we're at risk of failing. But each time that happens, we reach another junction and turn onto level ground. How far? Nick gasps. Just round the corner, I promise, Nick. Lani urges him on and Clarence drops back to grasp his wrist again. There's the top there. Lani points over the tops of the building ahead of us and sure enough, we can see the top of a church tower pointing into the heavens. The sight does more than any sugary drink will ever do. It gives us hope and a visible finishing line. Dave, Lani... We need to make sure we can go straight in, I shout out. Let me take Nick's bag. Tom holds his hand out as Dave passes it over and I can see the young policeman still has energy left in his system. Lani passes me Nick's axe and they race off side by side. The young Thai woman easily keeping pace with the ex-Special Forces soldier. Fucking look at them two, Cookie gasps. We urge, cajole, threaten and push each other on. Not one of us could have done this run on our own. The mental anguish would have been too great, but together, we've just about achieved it. Behind us, the horde gain with every junction we pass. The church is dead ahead of us now. A massive structure, just as Lani described, with high, narrow stained glass windows and a huge single tower that gradually thins to a sharp point at the very pinnacle. Lads, I take a deep breath and judge that we've only got a couple of hundred metres left to go. We need to sprint. Now! Move now! Clarence takes the order up and repeats it in his loud, deep voice. With nothing left but pure spit, we lengthen our strides and sprint it out. For the first few seconds, it actually feels nicer to be moving at a different pace, and the longer strides seem to stretch out sore thigh and calf muscles. But that's it. Those few seconds. After that, it's utter hell, and quite possibly one of the hardest things I have ever done in my life. But we do it. We reach the church and the low wall running round it. Dave is off to the left, waving us to follow him. We turn and head in his direction, and he leads us down a side path to a surprisingly well-built annex. I was expecting a cheap structure, cobbled together from the hard-pressed church funds, but this has been made with decent stone and strong modern windows. We go round to the back and into an open rear door. I have no idea who or how they got this open, and I don't have the breath to ask right now. One by one we run inside, and Dave slams the door shut, then starts gathering furniture to stack against the inside of it, creating a barricade behind us. 
Rage fuels us, and with grunts of animal anger, we grab bookcases, desks, chairs, and anything else we can find, and ram them high and deep against the wall. Shutters, Lani says, and I glance round to see the inside of the windows have wooden shutters. They're more decorative than anything, but they'll slow the horde down, and we spin round the large room, closing them to and snapping the thin locks down. A door opens into an office, through which is a thicker door leading to the church. Dripping sweat and swearing like the soldiers they are, Cookie and Blowers ransack the room in seconds until one of them is holding a big old-looking key up and shouting in triumph. The key fits the door, and it swings outwards, giving us the blessing we need, as it means they won't be able to smash it in so quickly. The door is solid, and would once have been the church's main rear door. We go through into the cool, dark interior, our breathing and heavy footsteps echoing round the high room. Dave gets the door closed, uses the key to lock it, and slams thick bolts home at the top and bottom. We start towards the back, looking for the main doorway that Lani mentioned, but Dave waves us down, telling us to get our breath, while Lani shows him the door which is further back along the church and off to one side. Two thick wooden doors! They'll hold for a while! Dave calls out. I nod back from my position of bent almost double, my chest still heaving. The sweat pours off my forehead, big drops continually falling to a puddle at my feet. Water! I shrug my bag down and take a bottle out, nodding and motioning for the others to do the same. They need little prompting, and we gulp the liquid down, quickly. Second bottles are opened then drained just as swiftly. Dave passes us on his inspection tour en route to the front, where the vicar or priest or head godman would normally stand. He opens another door and slips out of view, returning a minute later. The tower entrance is through here. There's a toilet with running water too, he calls across. Lads, get the bottles refilled. We could be here a while. They scoop down to pick their bags up and head through the door. Muffled bangs suddenly sound out from the annex, then after a couple of minutes, we hear more bangs on the main doors and the noise of glass windows being smashed. Looking up, I see the windows of the church are not as narrow as I hoped, but they are high up, depicting glorious images of saints bathed in golden light, crosses casting vibrant shadows, and one that appears to show God bearing down on a demon-like creature. Very apt, I mutter, and note that the window panes are lead-lined. They'll take some damage to beat them out and make a hole big enough for a man. Good choice, I shout to Lani as she appears from the door leading to the tower. She's used the running water to soak her hair and face, and I watch as she steps through, pulling her wet shining hair back into a ponytail. The front of her top is drenched and clings to her frame. I glance away quickly, hoping and praying she didn't notice me looking at her in that way. Thanks, Mr. Howie, she replies and walks over to stand next to me. Glad you let me come along then. Very, I smile at her and quickly look away again as she stares back, holding eye contact. I'm, uh, I'll go and get some more water. I can't believe that after running like that and everything that's happened, I still get nervous around pretty girls, especially when they're wearing soaking wet tops and sexily pulling their hair back like that. Going through the door, I see yet another solid wooden door propped open and thick stone steps leading away into the gloom. That must be the tower. A single bolt is on the inside, but it will be enough to slow them down and we can do a fighting retreat. Buying time. That's all this is. In the toilet, I see the lads have stripped their tops off and are noisily splashing water over their bodies and holding their steaming heads under the running water, giving appreciative groans of pleasure. They make way as Dave and I enter, and like them we strip, dunk our heads under, and gasp as the beautifully cold water hits the backs of our necks. I soak my top in the running water and use it to wash the sweat away from my upper body. Clarence stands at the end wash basin, bent over and keeps his huge, bald head under the running water for long minutes. I gulp the water down and keep going until I feel full, knowing I'll be pissing every few minutes for the rest of the night. As I lift my head, I catch my reflection for the first time in what feels like years. I'm not me anymore. Some bloke with a dark beard and curly dark hair stares back from the mirror. He looks tanned, and any trace of fat he once had on his face is gone. 
I find a dry top in my bag and quickly pull it down over my head and tuck it into my trousers, remembering Dave doing this very same thing back in the supermarket when we met. Was it really only nine days ago? Ready? The lads nod back, looking fresher and revitalised. We head back out into the main church room and hear loud bangs coming from all around us, echoing off the big empty room. Groans sound out every few seconds and I look up at the darkening windows knowing that night can't be that far away. We walk up towards the back of the church and peer into the recessed doorway. Two thick wooden doors are locked and bolted shut. It's too wide. If they break through together we won't be able to hold them. Grab some of these pews and shove them in there. Easier said than done, Howie. The long pew benches weigh a ton, and it takes three of us per pew to manhandle it into the doorway. Apart from Clarence, who drags one along on his own, scoring deep scratches into the ground from the end left on the floor. Get some more, and turn them round to make them like hurdles. It'll slow them down and give us a chance to get a few shots in before we get through that door to the tower. Again, we pull more pews over and stagger them in lines going away from the door, and leaving just enough room to squeeze through. Right, Blowers and Tom, you stay close to that back door. Cookie, Nick and Stephen, you stay close to this door and try to rest. Get your shotguns ready and make sure you have cartridges to hand so you can reload quickly. That last bit is said more for the benefit of Tom, Stephen and Lani, but I know the others will keep a close eye on them. Fuck me, Dave, that was evil. I mutter as the lads start to sort through their bags and get their weapons ready. What was? That bloody run, what do you think I meant? Oh, that. Yeah, it was quite long. Quite long, he says. You did well, though, Mr Howie. Thanks, mate. The lads did well, and that line is bloody fit. He looks at me with that gleam in his eye that I've come to know so well. I meant fit as in running and stuff. Yes, Mr Howie. Dave, I didn't mean it like I thought she's fit like hot or something. OK, Mr Howie. Is she not pretty, then? Fuck me, Dave. Are you asking my opinion on a woman? I reply, shocked. No, Mr Howie. You just did. I was asking your view, Mr Howie. That's the same thing, Dave. Is it? Oh, OK, Mr Howie. Well, I guess we just wait now. I might have a cigarette. Don't look at me like that, Dave. 14. Why didn't you make them go faster? Marcy demands as I stare up at the church looming above us and watch my babies probing the outside and looking for weaknesses. Because they still need air and blood the same as them. I point to the church. And the same as you and I. Just because they're zombies doesn't make them fucking Olympic athletes, Marcy. Don't swear at me, Darren. I wasn't swearing at you, my love. I was swearing in conversation. So that's Howie with the beard and the dark hair. Yeah, why? Fuck me, Marcy, you're always talking about him. No, I'm not, Darren, I was just asking. The small one was Dave, the big one Clarence. Who were the rest then? And who was that woman? Three of them were Blowers, Cookie and Nick. They're the ones that shouted at us and said you were fit. She gives a big grin at that, just like she did when she heard them shouting for me to send her over first back in that lane. I don't know who the others are. That girl was pretty, she muses. She was, I reply and catch a sharp look from her. What? You were grinning when they said you looked fit? That's different, Darren. How? Because I'm still a woman and any woman likes to be complimented. Yeah, well, double standards if you ask me. It's a good job I'm not asking you then, isn't it? She smiles acidly. So what now? Wait for night. They'll get all powered up when it gets dark and we can start sending them in. Right, we need a plan. There are two ways in, one through those big doors and the other through that side building. I suggest we split them up and send one group in through the back, another attacking the main doors and some more smashing those big windows to see if we can get through there. She stands with her hands on her hips, looking like a sultry army general ordering troops into battle. What do you think? She turns to face me. Well. And once we've got an entry opened up, we can go back to the original plan and send the group one in first and then the rest as we discussed. 
She cuts me off, having clearly made her mind up. Did you hear what they said about my jeans? I remember the insults, and it's only now that we've had the time and the breath to mention it. I told you I look stupid. They're just jealous. What about the plan? I felt stupid, I mutter. Oh, baby, don't look like that. They were just being mean for the sake of it. You look really nice dressed like that. Do you think so? Of course, my baby Darren, sweetie. Those nasty boys were just trying to upset you. Come here and have a bite of my neck and feel all better. She rubs my back as I nuzzle away and draw some refreshing blood down. There, that's better, isn't it? She says soothingly. I nod back and she wipes the blood from the corner of my mouth. Don't worry, you will have the last laugh when we get in there and eat them. OK, baby, I reply, feeling better but still feeling stupid dressed in these stupid clothes. Now about the plan, my sweetie, what do you think? She smiles up at me and holds my hands in hers. It's a good plan, baby. Really? She smiles. Do you think so? I think it's a great plan, Marcy. I nod, and she grins proudly before turning back to watch the church. OK, my lover. Can you split them up for me and send them where we said? OK, baby. She gives a little clap of joy as the horde suddenly stop moving freely and start responding to the control given from my mind. One group starts towards the big doors, another starts towards the annex, and the last lot I get mooching round for rocks, stones and anything that can be thrown to start breaking the windows. Oh, it's so clever! She claps excitedly again at the sight of our babies working to the plan she devised. You and I, Darren, my baby, are destined for big things. She throws her arms around me and slathers me in kisses before dropping her head down to bite into my neck and give herself some nourishment. Tonight, Howie. Tonight will be your last night on this earth, so make the most of it, you fucking little prick. 15. Daylight fades, and the interior of the church grows gloomier and darker by the second. Stacks of candles are discovered in a big box at the back of the church, and these get handed round with strict instruction to make sure they don't fall over and set fire to anything, seeing as we're now effectively trapped. Also, if we start retreating, then snuff them out as you fall back, I call out and get a series of responses. With the candles lit, the inside becomes soft and inviting. The stained glass windows reflect the flicker of the naked flames casting a warm, orangey glow over everything. The general noise from outside suddenly ceases, and the silence that follows becomes oppressive. All of us are waiting to see what happens next. What does happen is that the horde become directed and concentrated with two distinct attacks taking place. One at the main set of doors, and, judging from the muffled sounds in that direction, the other from the annex. They split them into teams, Clarence says quietly, looking first at the annex door we came through, then back to the main doors. Cooled off and rehydrated, we're left feeling a bit shaky and very drained from the massive expenditure of energy and excitement. Our breathing has become steadier, and I can feel a sense of weariness starting to descend. Cigarettes are lit, and I wonder when anyone was last allowed to smoke in here. How long will it take for them to get in? Lani asks, standing close to me and holding her shotgun one-handed down at her side. Not long. It'll be night any minute, and they'll get frenzied. Once they get through, we fall back to the tower and try to hold them off? Yep. We'll get as many as we can, try and reduce the numbers, but ultimately it's about keeping them focused and busy, letting Darren think he's got a chance of getting us. Otherwise, there's a risk he'll move off to try and target our group. Why isn't he doing that now? He could split his zombies and have some here and some going for the others, or just go for the others and leave us here. I don't think he'll be able to control them so well if he splits them like that. Also, he knows that if he moves away from here, we'll go after him and pick his horde off as they fall back. We are the primary objective, I'm afraid. But why? Why go after you so much? I get that there's history and stuff, but if he left you alone, you'd go back to your fort and he could do what he wants. I don't know. He must be obsessed. He knows we'll come after him, Dave adds in a quiet voice, and kill every one of those things in the process. Really? Would you do that if you had the choice to just live safely? 
Yes, we would, because we wouldn't be living safely. It would only be a matter of time before he comes back and tries again. We've got no idea how long those things can last for. Shit, it could be years if they get enough nutrition to keep them going, I reply. Or just a couple of weeks, she says hopefully. If they're dead and their bodies are slowly dying, then it can only be a matter of time. They don't eat, and even if they could eat humans, it wouldn't be enough to keep them going, surely. Some of them look like they're falling apart. That reminds me. Dave, did you see the state of the zombies at the front of the horde? I did, Mr Howie. I think he's putting the worst ones at the front and keeping the others back. He's doing what? Nick calls across. You must have seen the state of those zombies at the front. They were falling apart. It looks like Darren is keeping the best ones for last. What an utter cunt. Sorry, Lani. Cookie spits. I've heard worse, she replies. Oh, here we go. Make ready. I call out as all noise from outside ends. We all know what's about to happen, but knowing it doesn't make it any less scary. And standing in an old church with hundreds of those things outside just increases the tension. Long seconds go by with nothing. No noise, no sounds apart from our breathing and thumping hearts. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and then it hits. Hundreds of voices bursting out as one. Howling into the night sky, filling the air with horrendous screaming roars that send a shiver down my spine. The sound isn't human, and it stands as testament to the sheer threat of what we're facing. Hundreds and hundreds of guttural voices going as loud as they can. High-pitched, low-pitched, and every pitch in between, but they're combined and synchronised and truly, utterly terrifying. Lani steps closer to me, but she looks as poker-faced as Dave. All of us stare round at the walls, and I feel my skin crawling as the howls continue. Come by, my lord, come by, Cookie bursts into song at the top of his voice, making us all splutter with laughter. We're in a church, he shrugs, and starts again with Blowers and Nick joining in with him. By halfway through the first verse, we're all singing and screaming the words out as loud as possible. Clarence and Dave booming away with their deep bass voices. Giggles keep interrupting us, but the sound fills the church. Darren's a twat, my lord, come by, ah! Cookie sings the first words as Blowers starts laughing hard. Again, we join in with his new lyrics and blast the words out. The howling outside ceases, and we all pause, waiting for the frantic attack to begin. But instead, they start again. Louder, harder, and distinctly more aggressive. As soon as they start, we start, and the next few minutes are spent pitching our voices against each other, with Cookie making up new versions for each verse. Then it's over, and the night's work begins in earnest. Strong, concerted attacks start at the main doors and from the annex. Growls sound out, and even from in here we can tell they're faster and moving with stronger purpose now. The first of the loud, ragged thumps at the door cease, and then start again with a combined fury echoing throughout the high walls. Form up! I shout the order, and we gather at the main doors, knowing it won't take long for them to break them open. The pews we stuffed in will slow them down, but not for long. Fire in groups! Blowers, you take Tom and Lani. Dave will take Cookie and Stephen. Clarence, you're with me and Nick. Keep an eye on that back door. We fall back steadily, using the pews to fire from as we go, unless they all come flying in at once, in which case just run. Cover! Dave shouts at the same second as the windows all along the wall we're facing implode beneath the force of launched missiles. Glass fragments fly deep into the room as rocks bounce down on the wooden pews. We scoot forward and press ourselves against the wall either side of the main door. With no windows directly above us, we should be fairly safe. Rocks, stones and smashed up paving slabs come flying through the windows. More glass shatters and I wince at the damage being caused to such a lovely old building. A cacophony of noise clamours all around us. Howling from the undead, screaming in hunger and frustration. Loud, solid bangs from the doors. The splintering crash of breaking glass. We stay quiet, with Dave and me peering round the edges of the recess, checking the doors. Doors breaching! Dave says, loud enough for everyone to hear. The doors slowly start to give under the merciless weight of bodies being slammed against them again and again. My rate of breathing increases, and my heart slams inside my chest. 
Sharp focus comes into my eyes. A sense of excitement. Adrenaline getting ready to be released. Rage and fury start to build, but I won't let them control me now. The cost was too high, and I faltered the last time. It needs to be focused and used sparingly. Kill quickly, move quickly. Conserve energy. The doors start to give, gradually splintering and creaking with each successive thump. Then they split as the locks give, and a small gap forms in the middle. Ready, Dave? I shout over to my friend. We lock eyes, smiling at each other and seeing the sheer impatience for it to begin. Yes, Mr Howie, he growls back. Blowers, make ready to fire. Wait. Wait. Now! The doors give, slamming back against the pews and giving enough gap to allow the first two snarling monsters through. Blowers Tom and Lani lurch round to face into the recessed area and unload six shots within a split second, massacring the first two zombies. Hold! I raise my hand and watch as the next lot negotiate the bodies of the first two, blocking the path. The bodies get pulled back and I realise Darren must be close enough to watch and control them. Instead of powering through, they focus on slamming into the doors again and again, trying to force the gap to widen. Dave, Cookie, Stephen, go up and fire through the gap, now! They surge in, with Dave going low to fire his barrels out through the gap. Stephen fires above him, and Cookie jumps in as Stephen drops back. A very slight pause, and they start again, harder and more powerful. I catch a glimpse through the gap of one of the bodies being used as a battering ram. Held by several others, it is slammed repeatedly into the gap, pulping the already destroyed body. My lot! Now! I drop down, copying Dave's movement so I can fire with Clarence above me. Our shots are taken and we drop back. Another pause and then a huge crash as Darren sends a whole group surging forward to slam into the doors. The impact sends the pews back a couple of inches and before we have time to react and push them back, another round crashes in and forces the gap to widen even more. Fall back! We move out and take cover behind the first of the pews. More crashes and the doors widen with each massive impact. Then four of them burst through, snarling and scrabbling to be the first ones to take our flesh. Fire! Blowers shouts, and his group stand to unload all their shots, then drop down to quickly reload. The four undead become dead again as hundreds of pellets rip them to pieces, but more take their place. Fire! Dave's turn to shout and they fire into the recessed area, shredding the zombies to pieces. As quick as they fall, more surge in and I shout my turn. Firing our weapons and dropping down to reload as Blowers takes over. Blowers, Dave, me, and we repeat the action again and again until the bodies start to pile up and create a natural obstacle. Loud bangs sound from the door behind us, but it's outward opening and will take more to break through. Windows! Dave yells. I look up to see an undead clinging onto the windowsill and trying to rip the lead lining out. He grasps the lining between his hands while more zombies underneath yank him down hard, bringing the lead with him. Fuck me, that's clever! Cookie shouts as we reload. More undead appear at the windows, hoisted up high and ripping the lead down, forming holes big enough to get bodies through. I'll take them! Dave shouts as more zombies appear at the windows. We continue to fire into the killing ground of the doorway. The reduced range of the shotguns is vastly outweighed by the awesome firepower and the slaughtered corpses stack up. Blood and gunky pieces of flesh coat the walls, dripping down the pool on the floor. The doors and pews get peppered again and again by the pellets and the room reeks from the constant firing. Eardrums hurt and heads ache, but they go unnoticed as we fire again and again. A single howling zombie balances on the narrow sill above our heads and drops down. Dave is there instantly, knives drawn, and the thing is dispatched within a second, its head dropping from its neck and rolling across the flagstone floor. The back door is taking a hammering but holding firm. More undead clamber onto the window sills and start dropping in, only to be met by Dave spinning and dancing through them with his deadly knives. Not one of them takes more than a couple of steps before they're made dead again. Stephen, Tom and Lani all stand with their mouths open, watching mesmerised as Dave dances with his athletic grace, stretching, kneeling, leaping and spinning. Wait till he gets warmed up, Clarence shouts above the noise. 
Start moving back, I yell out in alarm as the fresh surge of zombies coming through the doors pick up some of the corpses and start using them as shields, gaining ground as the pellets slam into the cadavers but lack the power to rip all the way through the meat. As one, we move back a couple of pews, blowers taking the time to extinguish the candles as we retreat. Lani drops her shotgun for a second and runs at the undead falling through the windows with her meat cleaver drawn and ready. She slams the blade into her neck and extends her foot to kick it back before spinning round to slice the blade deep across a zombie face. Keep firing, I shout, and we let rip with the shotguns. All order is gone, and we all fire at will, reloading and firing both our barrels into the mass. The cadavers being used as shields quickly get shredded and discarded, but fresh ones are swiftly taken up. Time to go! Fall back! I yell out as they almost reach the edge of the threshold. Once there, they'll be able to spill out to both sides and start surrounding us. We fall back steadily, kicking candles out with our feet and plunging the room further into darkness. Dave drops back towards our group and kills the zombies coming at him, rather than rushing into their ranks and leaving us exposed. Rear door! Blower shouts as the wood splinters from the sustained battering. On it! Clarence bellows and shoves his shotgun into his backpack. Taking up his axe, he marches to the door and stands ready to repel. Keep going! I shout, and we fire our weapons at them as we negotiate the pews. They breach the edge of the recess and surge into the church, moving off to the sides. The shotguns are now rendered useless as they fan out. Mine gets shoved back into my bag, and like Clarence, I take up my axe and grip it two-handed. Ready, waiting, eyes fixed, growls sound out from zombies and humans as we retract into a tight bunch and edge back closer and closer to the door. They attack. Suddenly and with ferocious intent, and it's down to this again. Hand weapons and fighting to survive. My axe comes alive in my hands. An old friend that feels familiar and just right. I swing out, slicing deep into a neck and severing the head. Pull back and strike out again, cleaving a skull open and spilling brains onto the floor. A quick glance shows me the annex door is breached and Clarence is putting his own axe to deadly use, repeatedly chopping into each zombie that tries to clamber through the broken door. He checks round and sees us retreating and drops back to join the group. As we reach the door, Dave, Clarence and I take the front and fight them back while the others drop through one by one. I go next, leaving the two best fighters repelling the attacking zombies. Clarence next and Dave stands his ground as we draw breath and watch in wonder as the man holds steady and kills anything that dares get close to him. Clarence, pull me quick and slam the door! Dave's voice booms out. He knows that to take a step backwards will send them surging into the doorway and will never be able to close it. With one hand on the open door, Clarence leans out and grabs the back of Dave's rucksack. With a mighty heave, he pulls Dave clean off his feet and into the room with us. Slamming the door shut with his other hand, he drops Dave and shoves his body against the door. A single key lock holds the door, but it's enough to hold for a second while we cross into the tower stairwell and slam that door behind us too. Again, just a single bolt gets rammed home. Get reloaded and have water if you need it. With the door closed, I speak into pitch black until Dave and Nick rummage through their bags and turn small torches on, giving us enough light to see. Is there another door at the top? I ask Dave. No, the stairs spiral up to a landing, then start again. They get much narrower as they go higher. Okay, original plan then. We retreat slowly and keep cutting them down as we go. Everyone okay? Anyone hurt? My feelings are a bit hurt, Mr Howie. I think I might need some counselling, Cookie jokes. You need sectioning, mate, Blowers adds. Fucking come by ya, where did that come from? That was brilliant, Tom laughs. I remember singing that at school. See, stick with us, Tom, it's a laugh a minute. Just don't let yourself get caught alone with Blowers, Cookie says in a serious tone. Eyes front, Dave interrupts to the sound of the first door splintering open, followed a second later by loud thumps at the door just a few feet below us. Get into pairs. How are we for cartridges? We're OK, but they won't last long if we keep that rate of fire up, Dave answers. Stick with the shotguns for now and we'll switch to hand weapons when we get further up. Here they come. 
The doors burst open and the space instantly fills with the snarling faces of the undead. Change of plan, I shout and step forward with my axe, swinging it down to chop deep into the shoulder of the first one through the door. Use hand weapons now and save the shotguns for when they send the best ones through. Tom, up front with me. The staircase is wide enough for us to stand side by side and have enough room to swing down and batter them away. Tom responds quickly, joining me at the front as they pour through the door and start climbing the stairs. Dave drops down behind us and holds his torch so it shines down the stairs illuminating them and trying to blind them at the same time. Undead rush forward and I slice them down, cutting heads off and very slowly giving ground. They quickly muster and start attacking in greater numbers. Snarling vicious beasts with clawed hands, bared teeth and a wild, feral way of moving. Tom does well for his first proper fight, and he soon gets the hang of it, slashing away and cutting down into their heads. The bodies drop and roll backwards, but soon get trampled underneath the ever-encroaching fetid zombies. Next two, I yell out, keen to swap round and conserve our energy, and knowing how tired my arms got when I first started swinging my axe about, so knowing Tom must be feeling it. Ready, Mr. Howie? Cookie right in my ear. I press back against the wall as the lad steps past me and starts cutting them down. Breathing hard, I move further up the stairs as Nick takes over from Tom. You did well, mate, I say to Tom between breaths. Thanks. Tom looks at me with a glint in his eye that I've seen many times from the lads after a fight, and I know he'll do well from now on. The horde presses the attack, and with every minute that passes, it feels their attack becomes fiercer, more ferocious, and determined. Slowly giving ground, one step at a time, it's not long before Cookie and Nick swap round with Blowers and Stephen, and I realise our two best combatants are holding their turn for when they're really needed the most. Blowers, a proven warrior, steps in to take his turn, swinging out and culling their numbers with now practised ease. Stephen seems wild, though. He swings out too hard and repeatedly slams the axe into the wall at his side, jarring his arms and damaging the blade. His screams of fury seem more fear than anger. It's too dark to see his face, but I already know there'll be a wild look on it. He seems too intent, too angered, and far too eager as he hacks and swings away with wild abandon. Both Dave and I shuffle closer, getting ready to take action. Clarence steps down and taps my shoulder, motioning that he'll take over from the skinny lad. Stephen, move back! He ignores me and keeps swinging out, missing more than he's hitting, and I notice that his strikes are getting more arms and torsos than heads or necks. Blowers has to work harder to compensate for the ones Stephen keeps missing, and it's not long before they are pressing closer towards us. Mr Howie! Blowers yells in alarm at the sudden surge of bodies pushing forward. Dave is there instantly, shoving Blowers aside with his shoulder and dropping down a couple of steps to hold a central position. Holding the torch in his mouth, his arms spin out, slashing the blades across throat after throat. Sprays of hot blood pump out as the bodies sink down to slide down the already wet, slippery steps. He drops down and quickly moves the blade amongst their legs, severing Achilles' tendons and more bodies sink down. They use their arms to keep clawing and dragging themselves up, but they create a moving obstacle that the others find difficult to negotiate. Stephen, seeing the pause in fighting, lunges in front of Dave and starts hacking away at the packed zombies. Screaming with fury, he slips on the wet steps and crashes to the floor, sliding down the stairs until his body impacts on the front of the horde. We roar in warning and surge down to beat them back, but it's too late. Teeth are already sinking into Stephen's legs and thighs. He screams with agony and tries beating them off with his hands. Clarence, Dave and I all work like demons to slash down, hack at them and drive them back. Clarence, roaring like a bear, scoops up a man-sized zombie that writhes and gnashes in his hands. The giant man launches the snarling creature down into the front of the horde, and the momentum sends them all staggering and falling away. In the brief pause, Dave drops and grabs Stephen by the collar, dragging him away from the front as Clarence and Lani take front position, Lani taking up Stephen's fallen axe instead of her meat cleaver. Fuck it! I spit the words out as I see the ragged mess of Stephen's legs. The material has been torn away, flesh is hanging in strips down to the bone. Blood pisses out everywhere, and the poor lad is screaming in agony, begging to be saved and not left to die. Tom turns away, 
too distraught at seeing his friend dying. I quickly draw my pistol from my belt and fire a single round into his skull, blasting the back of his head off. Looking up, I see Dave, Blowers and the rest, staring at me before turning back to the matter in hand. Blowers, keep Tom at the back. Got it. I'm okay, Mr. Howie. Tom shouts in the darkness, but there isn't time to discuss it, and I look down to see Clarence and Lani forced to give more ground, moving steadily back towards us. As the stairwell turns into an ever-decreasing circle, so the steps become narrower until only one can stand out front, battering them back. Likewise, they can only send a few cramped zombies forward at once, but they do send them. They keep sending them. They send more and more, and we rotate our turns and swing our axes until our chests are heaving from the effort and our arms and shoulders are on fire, and every few minutes we're forced to move back. Some of the zombies take up the tactic they showed downstairs and use the dead cadavers as shields to hide behind while they charge up at us. Slowly at first, then more and more of them try it until every zombie that comes up is somehow holding a dead body in front of it. The end result is the same, but it takes far more effort and wastes vital energy hacking into corpses that are already dead, and we give more ground until we're getting onto the first landing. Someone hands me a bottle as I step back from my turn, and I first pour the water over my sweat-soaked skin before gulping it down quickly. No jokes from Cookie now. No banter or defiant shouting. This is messy, draining, hard work, and our low energy levels are dropping by the second. I realise I can see better, and looking round, I see a window set into the side of the wall, with bright moonlight shining through. Get the shotguns ready! I call out. Someone break that window and see what it's like down the bottom. Cookie uses the shaft of his axe to beat the glass out, and I hope to hell it falls down and slices Darren's face off. He rakes the shaft round, clearing the shards away, and sticks his head out. How is it? I shout over to him. You don't want to know? He ducks back in. Fucking loads of them down there. Still? Nick asks. We're only killing a few at a time, Dave explains. Fuck, Cookie says. Fuck, he repeats, and like the rest of us, he shrugs it off and stands up, ready with his shotgun. Ready, he shouts, and strides over to the top of the stairs. We join him and shout for Clarence and Lani to fall back. Lani goes first, ordered by Clarence. She scoots through and drops down with her chest heaving. I pick up a bottle of water and go to hand it to her, but she's dropped down on her hands and knees, breathing hard. She's fit enough to run for miles, but swinging a heavy axe has clearly drained her. You're doing well, I say quietly. The first of the shotguns fires, followed by more, and the sounds of the guns breaking open and fresh cartridges being shoved in. Rest for a minute. I twist the lid from the top of the water bottle and use one hand to lift her chin up while I pour water gently down her face and then the back of her neck. She breathes with her mouth open and even in this light I can see she looks flushed. She turns round to rest with her back against the wall and I hand her the bottle. Drink and rest for a minute. Thanks, she says softly and presses the bottle to her lips. Standing up I see Blowers and Cookie looking down with concern. She okay? Cookie asks. I'm fine, she says, her voice as strong as ever. Well, get back down and fuck em up some more then, Cookie retorts and gets a middle finger in response from Lani. We rest for a minute or so, using the shotguns to blast them back down, and when my turn comes, I watch with satisfaction as the power of the weapon stands true and blows their heads apart. They've stopped, Nick shouts as he aims his unfired gun into the darkness. We gather round and stare down, looking at mangled bodies, but nothing else. Get ready to move back, I say quietly, guessing Darren is gathering a load to send up together and pressing the attack. Mr. Howie! My guess is right as his mocking tones bounce up the stairs to me. Smithy, how are you, mate? Uh, it's Darren now, please, Mr. Howie, he yells back. Oh, is it? Yeah, it is. How you doing up there? We got one, didn't we? Just the one so far, Smithy. Not that good, considering how many we've killed. Oh, I've got plenty more yet. Have you now? Tell you what, Smithy, why don't you grow a pair and come up yourself? Me and you, Smithy, no weapons, just me and you. Yeah, right. 
What, and that little cunt runt Dave is just going to stand and watch? They won't do anything, Smithy, you have my word. Come up and we'll end this. Oh, Mr Howie. You're a fucking coward, Smithy. You send all these things to do something you're too scared to do yourself. I bellow down. Fuck you! He screams in utter rage. No, Darren! A female voice yells. Get off me, Marcy, I'm not a fucking coward. Yes, he is, Cookie shouts. Marcy, is that your name? I saw you earlier. I'm Howie. It's very nice to meet you, Marcy. I keep my tone very polite, knowing it'll wind him up. Hello, Howie. A sultry voice floats up and I look round to see Blowers and Cookie smiling, eyebrows raised. So you don't want to send Smithy up then? I ask. No, she answers simply. Well, how about you then? It's not too late, Marcy. You've picked the wrong side. Thank you, Howie, but I'm fine where I am. A hint of humour in her voice. Uh, I don't have to call you Mr Howie too, do I? Of course not. So how's this going to end, Marcy? When will Smithy realise we won't stop until every one of those things is dead, including him? Oh, Darren won't lose, Howie. Her sultry, husky tones sound out. Maybe you should come and join us. I would like that very much. Her voice drops to an even more sultry tone, and I just catch the sound of muffled voices, Darren getting angry at her overtly flirtatious manner. Well, that's a very kind offer, but I will have to pass. That's a great shame, Howie. We could have gotten to know each other better. True. Tell me, seeing as you can talk and think the same as before, why stick with Darren? Come with us and maybe we can find a cure. We've got doctors and equipment that can help you. Well now, Howie... If I came up those stairs and surrendered myself to you, your lovely boys would kill me instantly. No, they won't, Marcy, I promise you. But how would you know I wouldn't bite you, Howie? Would you tie me up? The tone she inflects is so downright flirty that my mouth drops open in surprise. Looking round, I can see most of the others are the same too, apart from Cookie, who's grinning like a Cheshire cat and loving every minute of it. Come up here and try it, you rancid, diseased whore! Lani's voice booms down the stairs to the shock of everyone else. And it is Mr. Howie to you, bitch! Oh, Howie, got yourself a lady friend. Is that the girl with the dark hair I saw you with? She is very pretty. For an Asian girl, that is. You said we couldn't use racism. Shut up, Darren, Marcy snaps back in a harsh tone. Yeah, shut up, Darren, Cookie mocks. Do as you're told, there's a good boy. Was that her idea to wear those trousers like that, Smithy? Nick shouts down. Fuck off, Nick! His voice screams up, which sets the lads laughing. Yeah, Nick, fuck off! Cookie mocks again in a camp voice while I look at Lani in puzzlement. She glances round to see me staring and smiles, giving a faint shrug of her shoulders. Sorry, but I don't like her, she says quietly. No, don't apologise, it's fine. Dave slips behind me and draws my pistol from my belt. Silently, he starts creeping down the stairs with the handgun and torch held out in front of him. He looks round at Cookie and motions for him to keep going. Smithy, how many boy zombies have you bummed so far? Fuck you, Cookie, I'm not blowers. Ah, blowers, even the twat super zombie knows you like bumming. Cookie laughs. Dave reaches the bend and quickly darts round, switching the torch on and firing down with quick successive bangs. I hear the sound of bodies falling and more scrambling to move away. Dave finishes the magazine and climbs back up. Almost, but he was covered. Dave shakes his head as the hordes suddenly start charging up with a nasty snarl. Back to work we go, using the shotguns to drive them back but quickly giving ground as they really press the attack home. Within seconds, we're across the landing and round the next bend at the start of the next flight of stairs. Each one of us works to reload and fire as quickly as possible. We get constant kills in, and with every gun firing twice, I know we must be culling their numbers, little by little, but at least we're doing it. Hand weapons! I give the order to switch, seeing the narrower stairwell on the second flight, and knowing it'll be easier to hold them back. Taking first stand, I ready myself as they pour across the landing and sweep round the curvature. Axe ready, I swing out, chopping the first one down and lifting the double blade up and into the groin of the next one. They both tumble down, and I slam down into the next one, making it fall into the heap of the other two. 
The next one uses the heap of bodies as a springboard and launches itself at me. The axe catches him mid-air and slams him into the wall, but I have to give ground in case they keep doing it. More kills and I swap round when my arms start to feel jaded. Taking it in turns, we hack and kill, slowly reducing their numbers. The minutes tick into hours and we slowly rotate, giving ground slowly but surely. Drinking water and breathing hard every time we take a break. Lani insists on taking her turn again and stands out front with determination and sheer guts, swinging the axe with all her might and chopping them down one after the other. I hand her a bottle of water as she drops back to let Clarence take over and she gulps it down after giving me a quick smile. All of us, well, maybe apart from Dave, feel the fatigue kicking in. Tiredness starts creeping into our limbs and any conversation we have is stilted and abrupt. Tom takes his turn quietly and fights with passion, clearly using the time to give vengeance for the loss of his close mate. Then it's back to me and I take my glorious axe and stand in position. The first one comes charging in with a howl, drooling lips pulled back to show me his yellow stained teeth. As I slam the axe down into his head, something snaps in me. The righteous glory of battle descends and I feel my limbs come back to life. Just as they did at the end of that big fight when I was on my knees. Each swing of the axe seems calculated and intense. Every slash takes one down and I'm already eyes up watching the next one come. The pressure builds in me and I roar my defiance out. Screaming into the darkness, I kill them quickly. We've been giving ground since we started, but maybe we should take a bit back. I step down and repeat my killing blows, watching undead after undead drop before my eyes. My eyes that paint the target for the axe. The axe that is as much a part of me as my heart. My heart that beats pure, clean blood and sends me down to do battle with these filthy, spawning creatures. Every step I take down is a victory for mankind. They keep coming but my movements get faster and faster until I am one with my weapon. Slicing left, right, up, down, each one a killing blow. My feet are firm and my steps do not falter, and I take back the ground we gave to them. Time ceases to flow. Everything is paused as I descend into the bowels of darkness. I don't need light to show me the way. I don't need anything but what I am right now. In this holy place I feel strong, powerful yet strangely humbled. Humbled that I have been allowed to use this gift in such a way. They come at me harder and faster than ever before. They surge and lunge. They gnash their teeth, but I smile at them. I show them a death full of grace and pity, but one delivered with brutal honesty. Still they come, and still they die, and still I keep moving forward. I hear nothing but the sound of the axe moving through the air. I see nothing but the target in front of me. The Landing I move across the landing and tread firmly over the bodies already downed. The stairwell is wider here and I give thanks that I can stretch my swings out and move with more room. I plough on. Nothing exists. Time and space are a memory, a thing of inconsequential nothingness that doesn't belong in this place. Left, right, up, down, I kill and they die. Back at the top of the landing, I feel a burst of strength and my movements become even faster and I clear them away with such speed that it all seems too slow for me. Then suddenly there's a gap, and I'm standing at the top of the landing, staring out of the window at the bright moon. Drop back, Mr. Howie! Dave pulls the axe from my hands and takes my place at the top of the stairs. I do as instructed, and move back. Everyone stares at me, mouths hanging open and eyes wide. I feel tired now, bone-weary and tired, but I feel peace within me and I take the bottle of water that Lani hands me and drink the cool, satisfying liquid down. Thanks, that was nice. I hand the bottle back and she stares at me with a puzzled expression. I look to my right and see Clarence watching me too. He is shaking his head and a small wry smile forms on his mouth. That's twice you've done that now, boss, he rumbles. Ah, well, I fancied a change of tactic for a minute. Fuck me, Mr Howie, I hope I never piss you off, Cookie says with a look of such awe that it makes me feel uncomfortable. Nick, have you got any smokes, mate? Yeah, sure, hang on. He drags a packet out from a pocket and taps one out, hands it to me with a lighter. Once lit, I inhale and lean against the wall with my back to everyone else. 
The sense of peace is stunning. A tranquil, soothing sensation that comes up from deep within me, but leaves me so tired and weary. Here, I was saving this, but you can have it. I think you might need it. Lani hands me a bottle of Coke. I smile back and twist the cap off before taking a big gulp of the wonderfully sugary fluid. Oh, that is bloody nice. I hand it back. Pass it round. I think we all need some. There is a yell from Dave and suddenly we're moving back from a fresh attack, pressed home by an incredibly fierce load of undead. Driven back, we slowly ascend the stairs as this new lot drive forward with an as yet unseen level of violence. These must be the best ones that Darren was holding back. They look less decayed than any other zombies I've seen. The only visible injuries are just small bite marks to their necks. I think you've pissed them off, Blowers yells as he fights like a demon himself. He slams his axe back and forth, but we're driven further back and up the stairs. We start using shotguns, firing from underneath the person out front, such is the desperation of their attack. Firing and reloading and still giving ground. Higher and higher up the narrowing staircase we go, twisting round and round. Clarence takes over at the front, but the restricted space makes it hard for him to move easily. He fights for a few minutes, still being pressed back. We're at the top, Lani shouts. Glancing round, I see the moonlight shining down onto the stairs. Fall back and get ready to close the door, I shout loudly, and the others swiftly obey, running up into the clear air. Staying right behind Clarence, Dave and I guide him backwards until he suddenly flattens himself against the wall and Dave takes over, using his knives to good effect in the confined space. With short, sharp slashes, he kills them one by one. Leaving Dave to hold the stairs, I stagger out into what I was hoping would be lovely cool air, but instead feels far too warm and muggy for the middle of the night. Leaning over the chest-high railing, I look down and see a few bodies dotted about, but not too many. Cookie, are there less than when you looked earlier? He leans over and examines the grounds round the bottom. A lot less, Mr Howie. He grins that infectious grin and drops back down. The platform skirts the square-shaped tower in a narrow walkway. There are no other exits, so we have to hope and pray we can hold them off. Just a couple more hours and it'll be getting light. Blower stares out at the darkened town and the orange glow coming from the fire raging in the distance. If we get out of this, I'm going straight down to the beach to cool off in the sea, Nick sighs and wipes the sweat from his face. I am up for that, mate, I reply. That's after the cooked breakfast with loads of toast and coffee, he adds wistfully. And fresh orange juice, I add to the dream and regret it instantly as it makes the reality taste as sour as it really is. Who's going after Dave? Uh, Mr Howie, Tom says suddenly with a tone of urgency. I join him, leaning over the rail and staring down at the ground, at the dark figures standing around something that flickers and flares brightly. Then more of them flare up until there's a row of bright things. My tired eyes take a few seconds to send the images to my brain for processing, and what I'm looking at banishes all tiredness within a split second. Mr Howie, they've pulled back again, Dave yells through the door. I bet they have. They're going to burn us out, I shout back. With alarmed yelps, everyone rushes over to look down. The flaming things, whatever they are, get carried towards the church and out of view. They're setting the church on fire, Clarence says, his voice calm and natural. Options? We can fight our way down or try and wait it out. I race round the walkway, peering over the side. The tower is high, and it would mean instant death to jump from here. The tower is joined to the main building, but that's still a good 15 feet below us, and the roof is sharply angled. A wrong landing, and we would just slide down the side and fall into their laps. The only option is to go back down the stairs and fight our way through the horde and out into the open. Unless Darren has pulled all his zombies back and left us a clear exit, which is not likely. Not likely at all. Here, Mr Howie, Nick calls out. He is shining his torch over the side. Thick drain pipe, he points, as I rush over to him. That should hold our weight. The wrought iron drainage pipe is bolted to the wall and must be strong if it's to take all the water from this roof. It might hold Dave and Lani, but definitely not Clarence, I reply. It might do, Mr Howie, I'll try it. Nick clambers up to the ledge and starts easing himself over the other side. What's he doing? Clarence joins me looking down and I tell him about the drain pipe. 
We watch as Nick leans down and starts tugging on the pipe. Then, holding his weight with both hands, he rests his foot on it and slowly shifts his weight. He's not moving, he stares back up. Okay, get back up, mate. Clarence, can you pull that wiring down? I point up to the thick electric cable snaking around the tower and providing a power supply to the lamps positioned to illuminate the spire at night. With his bare hands, Clarence yanks one end from the lamp and follows it round, snapping it free from the wall connectors. The rest gather at the railings, looking down at the drainpipe, Nick points out. Dave, are you okay? I yell through the door. Fine! Dave bellows back, and I can see he's holding ground and not given an inch yet. They're setting the church on fire, trying to burn us out. Are they? Okay, Mr. Howie. Nothing phases that man. I could have told him Darren had an atomic bomb he was detonating, and the response would have been the same. Back outside, I watch as Clarence ties one end of the cable to the railings and drops it down to rest by the drainpipe. I'll go first, Lani says confidently. I'm the lightest by far, so let me try it. A whooshing sound reaches our ears, and we crane over the side to see strong light now coming from the broken windows, illuminating the grassy area surrounding the church. Without another word, Lani tightens the straps on her bag and wedges Stephen's axe down the back of it before climbing over the railings. Grasping the electric cable, she starts lowering herself down, rapidly dropping hand under hand and lowering herself into the darkness. Nick shines the torch down and we watch as she runs out of cable before reaching the bottom and switches her hands onto the drainpipe for the last few feet before she drops nimbly onto the roof. Smiling, she gives a thumbs up. Blowers, you go next and provide cover in case anything happens down there. On it, he copies Lani, shoves his axe down the back of his bag and climbs over the railings. With a grim smile and nod, he takes the cable and starts lowering himself down, switching to the drainpipe as the cable runs out and dropping down onto the roof. Nick follows them, repeating the actions and straining with the effort of holding his weight on the thin cable. He takes longer to swap from cable to pipe, but eventually, with a thud, he too drops down. Tom, then Cookie, go down easily enough until there's just me, Dave and Clarence left. Dave, we found a way down. There's an electric cable and drain pipe running down the side of the tower onto the church roof. There's just me and Clarence to go. The rest are down already. I'll hold them here, Mr Howie. You go and I'll catch you up. Dave, when Clarence shouts, you start coming. Got it? Got it? He continues his killing spree, which has slowed down remarkably from either him killing them all or because the fire is raging too much to send any more up. Outside, I stuff my axe down into my bag and climb over. Taking the cable in my hands, I copy what the others did and start lowering myself down. The cable bites into my fingers and hurts, but it's just thick enough to grip and I use my feet to scrabble as I steadily get lower. The cable runs short, as I'd seen with the others, and I reach out to grasp the drainpipe, which holds firmly, and within a few seconds, I'm standing on the roof with one foot either side of the apex. Feel the roof, Mr Howie, Cookie urges me. I drop my palm down and feel the warmth radiating through the rough tiles, and the strong smell of wood smoke reaches my nose. Glancing over, I can see plumes of smoke starting to waft from the empty windows. Clarence's huge bulk straddles the railings and he starts dropping down much faster than the rest of us did. He's either very experienced at doing this or he's shitting himself that his heavy weight will snap the cable. At the same point as us, he reaches over and shifts his weight from cable to pipe and continues his downward journey. A popping noise sounds out and a bolt falls to land between my feet, rolling off down the side of the roof. More follow as the drainpipe creaks under the heavy burden of Clarence. With a few metres still left to go, it breaks free from the wall and swings down with Clarence still attached. He manages to get his feet underneath him, ready to try and land properly, but the force of his weight sends him straight through the tiles. The others burst away, desperately trying to avoid being crushed. Scorching heat rushes from the hole in the tiles and I crab forward to see Clarence clinging onto the drainpipe, edged over the hole he made, his feet dangling above the raging inferno below him. Hold the ends of the pipe! Shouting out, I grasp one end and watch as the others snake over to stop it sliding off. 
Clarence does one mighty pull-up and starts levering himself up, grabbing the sides of the roof and not risking his weight on the pipe any more than he has to. We grab at his arms and backpack, pulling his enormous weight out from the hole. The heat is intense and I can feel my face sweating already. The drain pipe starts to shift and slide as the edges of the hole crumble and give way. We dig in and with shouts of pure effort, we inch him out bit by bit. The hole gets larger as Clarence strains and wrestles to get his upper body out enough to swing his legs up. Gradually, he gets out and lies panting for a few seconds. Are you hurt? I start to check his legs for burns, but other than feeling hot, there doesn't seem to be any damage. I'm okay, he rumbles back. Did we get Dave down? On hearing his words, we all look up to see Dave dangling from the cable with one hand and patiently waiting for us to stop pissing about. Clarence springs to his feet and grabs the drain pipe, clenching it between his muscled arms. He leans it against the wall just to the side of Dave. Blowers and Nick brace Clarence as Dave nimbly swings out and starts a quick descent down the pipe, placing one foot on Clarence's bald head as he slides down his back to land with a wry grin. Sorry about your head, Clarence, he says flatly as ever. No, you bloody not, Clarence rubs his smooth head, grumbling away to himself. Time we weren't here, I mutter quietly and start walking along the apex one foot either side and heading for the far end. They've seen us, Dave bellows. Well, if they hadn't, they would have bloody heard us, that's for sure. I'll go first, Dave adds. Piss off, you're not having all the fun. I reach the end and look down. Too high to jump, but I spot a grassy bank a couple of feet out from the end. Turning round, I plant my arse on the tiles and draw my axe from behind me. Letting myself slide down the now very hot tiles, I reach the lowest point and jump down to land heavily on the top of the grass bank. The axe falls from my grasp as I land, and I don't have time to go for it before the first of the undead lunge at me. Fortunately, only a couple have made it round this end so far. I charge at him and slam my forehead into the middle of his face. Pain explodes behind my eyes, but it does the trick, and we both go down with me landing on top of him. My fists rain down, smashing the shit out of his head, before I jump back and draw the pistol from my belt. He's up instantly, and I fire several times into his face, then lift the pistol and fire at the next one coming. He drops, but more are behind him and coming fast. Dave drops to my side and instantly draws his knives. Get your axe! And he's off, charging them with a deep roar. Changing magazines, I reholster the weapon and scoop my axe up before racing forward and joining my friend. We stand together, hacking them down as more of our group slide down the roof and land heavily on the top of the bank, sprawling out with yelps of pain. A shotgun blasts out to my side and I see blowers quickly reloading and firing again. His shot hit home and burst heads apart as Dave spins about, killing anything that moves. Cookie joins him, then Lani and more until we're back together. Which way, Lani? Downhill, please, Nick begs. We need that road. She points to a junction off to the left and we start moving that way. Forming into a small circle, we lash out as the horde keep charging at us. Blowers, Cookie and Nick use their shotguns for several minutes, but even in the dark, I can see there are still plenty of undead left. We keep moving and pick the pace up to try and stop them getting round behind us. They charge forward, but their attacks are sporadic instead of concerted. Still, we keep on as the church burns brightly behind them, flames licking out of the windows. They start to get coordinated and several attack at once. But with experience on our side, we hack them down with our axes, swinging out and gouging deep into their flesh, killing with every few steps we take. Reaching the junction, we start moving downhill, but that just gives them momentum in their charges, and I can feel the weight of their bodies with every strike I make with my axe. My arms are burning, and my legs shake and weaken with every step. I can sense everyone is feeling the same, and the only thing that keeps us going is the fear of letting each other down. That and the bloody-minded stubbornness of refusing to roll over and die quietly. They race past us and start trying to lunge in at the sides, but for every desperate zombie face that tries to gnash and bite, there is a dead zombie falling to the ground with its head cleaved open. Grunts of effort emanate from behind me, and then I realise that I'm doing it too. Making noises like a tennis player going for an ace serve, 
Looking across, I see even Dave is starting to look tired, and his normally pale face is flushed red, which just makes him look angrier than normal. Clarence stumbles from a powerful swing and almost staggers out from our tight circle. Undead rush him, but Dave springs out and slices them down as the big man rights himself and falls back into the round. That's for stepping on your head, Dave shouts, and even his voice sounds hoarse. Clarence doesn't reply but focuses on the same thing we all are, staying alive and keeping motion. We battle all the way down that bloody street, leaving a trail of broken and mangled bodies in our wake but still they come. Darren must have pulled them from the church and kept them safe. Safe and waiting for us so he can grind us into the ground. But he doesn't do that. For some miraculous reason, our strategy works. Using axes and shotguns, we've stayed alive, and even if we die now, we've killed hundreds and hundreds of them again. Son, someone croaks, and I realise it's now much lighter than before. The only hope we've got of surviving is if they drop back when the sun comes up, but Darren must see how exhausted we are, that we're ready to drop. The sky lightens as we head further down the hill, closer and closer to the beach and pier. They drop back, keeping pace but holding off from attacking, and I can sense a change coming. We increase our speed, not knowing where we're going or why we're going faster, but it gives us a sense of purpose and something to aim for. More undead gather into their front ranks, and we realise they're massing for a final attack, preparing themselves for an offensive manoeuvre intended to finish us off. There, further up the hill, I see Darren and that woman pacing a safe distance behind their zombies and holding them off until greater numbers can stagger forward and join their horde. Dave and I both see him. We see that thing that has created all this death. Shotgun blasts sound out as the lads take advantage of the pause to get a few shots in. They do good work and whittle a few down. Cookie presses his pistol into Dave's hands, and the small man fires one-handed, getting a headshot nearly every time. He passes it back, and another one is handed to him. He fires again, dropping more, and suddenly their numbers are reducing. Go into them, I roar and change direction. We start pacing forward, letting Dave fire pistols and taking the advantage away from them. Shotguns blast and the pistol fires. They die in numbers they can't afford to lose. The last remaining energy in my body surges into my muscles and we press home the attack. Darren realises we're killing too many and he sends them in. One final battle and we fight. We fight hard. Our power is low and every strike or swing hurts more than anything ever imaginable but we stay on our feet and swing out with everything we've got. Clarence stumbles again and drops his axe. They charge, but he raises his fists and starts punching out, keeping them at bay. One of Dave's knives leaves his wet hand stuck in the skull of a falling zombie, but he presses on with one last blunt knife until it becomes nothing more than a useless tool, and like Clarence, he ditches it and takes to using his bare hands. My axe flies back and forth, lifting high and slamming down, but I feel weaker with every second. Another swing, but it gets caught mid-air in the strong grip of a female zombie, still fresh-looking, with hardly any decay on her yet. She pulls the axe clean from my hands, and I draw my pistol and fire point-blank into her face. She drops down, and I pick my shots, taking time to hit the skull. I have to keep stepping to avoid being taken. My pistol clicks empty, and I start using it to hammer into their faces. I punch and gouge and writhe like a bastard to avoid their dirty teeth. My knee rises again and again into stomachs and groins, lashing out in a filthy street brawl. I start to get overwhelmed until Lani lashes out with her meat cleaver, driving them down and saving my life. I see a house brick nearby and pick it up. It becomes my new weapon as I slam it into the face of anything that comes at me. Circling round, I see my axe nearby and run to scoop it up, throwing the house brick hard at the head of a zombie about to bite into blowers. Axe in hand, I carry on swinging round as a glorious broad stripe of orange sunlight hits the pavement. The rays shine through the gaps in the buildings. Darren starts to lose control as some of them instantly slow to become the shambling daytime idiots. Others keep going, but the fight is over. We know it, and so does Darren. 
For the last few minutes, we kill off the remaining zombies in a blur of tiredness that staggers me to the core. Fall back! Dave's hoarse voice yells and we start retreating, letting the last few come at us instead of wasting our energy. Forming our circle, we retreat, stumbling like the daytime zombies now shuffling slowly after us. Lani leads us down a side street and then back down the hill. They keep coming, but only one at a time now, and they're easy to finish off. As we turn to start moving down the hill, two figures stand at the far end of the street. Darren and Marcy stand amongst their ruined horde and stare quietly as we back away. On seeing them, I stop moving and stand still, staring back with my axe held down at my side. The others join me, spread in a line and staring back at the two figures. No one moves. They neither come forward nor retreat, but stand watching us silently. I want to go after them, but I've nothing left. My voice is low and rough, barely more than a whisper. They'll run, and none of us have the energy to chase them, Dave replies. But I watch his hand slowly pulling a pistol from his waistband. He ejects the magazine and quickly glances down to see it's empty. I need a bullet, he whispers. Just one. Here. Blower slowly digs one out from his pocket and passes it along the chain, hand to hand until it reaches Dave. I was saving it for him. Dave gently slots the bullet into the top of the magazine and pushes it up into the pistol. He slides the top back and chambers the round. He stands with the pistol lowered and looks at the two zombies standing at the far end of the street. The distance is huge for a pistol shot. He holds still for a second before looking up into the sky and turns his head. His fingers flex on the pistol grip. Which one? he asks. Do you need to ask? I reply. He takes a deep breath and slowly exhales. Then moving with incredible speed, he raises the pistol and fires. A solitary retort sounds out, followed a split second later by one of the figures falling to the floor. 16. The day is going to be hot again. The air is listless without the slightest breeze. My rate of breathing has slowed and my heart gradually eases from the frantic work it's had to do all night. There is blood on my hands and all down the front of my clothes, sticky and moist. I can feel the wet material clinging to my skin. Here in this quiet suburban street on the Isle of Wight, I look back at the long line of corpses littering the road. At the top of the hill, the church blazes fiercely, thick smoke coiling up high into the blue sky. That was a good shot. It was. I can't feel my legs. Your spine is broken. So this is it. Yes. Do you want me to say sorry and beg for forgiveness? No. What do you want? Nothing. Then why are you watching me? Waiting for you to die. I might not die. You're bleeding out. Am I? Oh, shit. Even you can't lose that much blood. It doesn't hurt. That's a pity. She'll come after you. I don't care. I told her to go after you. She won't stop. She's better than me. Stronger. Clever. Cunning. I don't care. You can't win this, Howie. Neither can you. She's got my blood and everyone she bites will have my blood. I don't care. They'll die just like you are now. I'm tired. You're dying. Feel so tired now. Die then. I'm scared. I die quietly. Howie, please. What, Darren? What do you want? Oh, God. I don't want to go like this. Close your eyes, Darren. Let it take you. No, please. Let it happen. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, Howie. 
Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Me too, Darren. Forgive me. Please? No. Please. I, oh, shit. I'm going. Darren. Howie, please. I forgive you, Darren. Rest now and let it take you. Shit. Oh, shit. I'm bleeding. Howie? Yes, Darren. How? Howie? Yes. Fuck you, Howie. He dies with a smile on his face. And just to be sure he dies fully and properly, Dave drops down and detaches his head with an axe and kicks it down the road. Marcy disappeared as soon as we started walking back towards them, and with so much death and destruction, it'll be near impossible to track her. I know because I asked Dave and Clarence. I feel numb and strangely flat, like I was expecting a fanfare or some divine light to shine down when we finally got him, but nothing happened. We stood in a filthy street and watched a former friend die. Now, standing round the body, I can feel a deep sense of sadness that any of this had to happen. That was a good shot, Dave, I say, just to break the oppressive silence. I was aiming for the head. What, from that distance? I'm tired, so I missed. Bloody hell, Dave, you still got him. Yes, Mr Howie. I'm bloody starving, Nick interrupts, rubbing his stomach, and I still want that swim. Well, let's go down the hill, then. We'll find some more clothes and food, have a swim, and then find somewhere to sleep. Sound good? Fuck, yes, please, Cookie replies. Tom, you are right, mate? I'm fine, Mr Howie. You did well, mate. Sorry about Stephen. Thanks. He nods back, but his face remains expressionless. Lani, you too. You did well. Cheers. She smiles once, bright and gorgeous. Can we go, please? I'm hungry too, and I desperately need to wash. Yep. Yeah. Fair one. 17. We head down through the deserted town centre, walking slowly in the beautiful morning. No one speaks. All are absorbed in their own thoughts and utterly exhausted. I wonder if Tom and Lani would have come if they'd known just how bad it would get. She takes us to a cheap clothes shop with the windows already smashed in and we each grab clean tops, underwear, socks and a mixture of jeans and cargo trousers. Lani grabs a bikini from the shelf and makes it known that she will not be swimming in her underwear and that if anyone tries to swim naked she will shoot them. Does that include blowers? Cookie asks, seeing as he likes boys and not girls. Cookie, fuck off, Blowers retorts with a shake of his head. In a cafe, we find tins of baked beans with mini pork sausages in them. Our hands are washed and scrubbed in the kitchen, using copious amounts of detergent to rinse the filth off. Eating straight from the tins with our axes stuffed down our bags, we stroll down the hill, throwing the empty tins straight onto the ground and using the single tin opener we found to open more and stuff the contents into our mouths as quickly as possible. Reaching the esplanade, we stare down the road at the blackened, still smouldering buildings. Finally on the beach, we ditch our kit and start stripping off. The mood lifts slowly, with idle banter being thrown back and forth. Lani makes Clarence stand with his back to her and holding a huge towel she got from the shop. She ducks round and changes into her bikini, telling Clarence to make sure no one tries to sneak a peek. He stands like a protective bear, glaring at the lads, laughing and daring him to have a quick look. They fall silent when she steps out. We all do. The violent, toughened zombie killer stands looking demure and breathtaking in her simple black bikini. I have to look away and busy myself with undoing my bootlaces, otherwise I would happily sit there gawping all day. That's shut you up, she laughs. So is a girl going to be first into the sea? She starts running as the lads shout that they're not ready yet. Ditching clothes as they run, they sprint down the beach and into the water, leaving me, Dave and Clarence wondering where they got the energy from. Dave, you're not coming in? I ask as he stands there still dressed. I don't like the water, he shakes his head. I'll keep watch here. Clarence and I stroll down slowly, enjoying the already warm sun on our bare torsos. The water is cool and refreshing, sending shivers through our tired bodies. 
The laughing eases as each person relaxes and lets the salt water cleanse them, ducking heads under and rubbing our hair, faces and bodies to rid them of the encrusted dirt. Lani swims over to me as I float on my back, my arms and legs making occasional small movements to keep me afloat. I'm guessing we'll need somewhere to rest for a few hours, she asks. Yeah, the pier looks good. I nod towards the long black structure stretching out into the water just a short distance away. Okay, her voice trails off suddenly hesitant. What's up? Is it okay to come with you? She asks quietly. Bloody hell, Lani, I laugh gently. I just assumed you would be. Of course you should come. I didn't want to just think it was okay. You're one of us now, Lani, a hardened killer of zombies, one of the elite. I laugh again and she smiles back, a huge grin that suddenly makes me nervous again. Thanks for last night, she says. Eh? When you poured water on my face and made me rest, thanks for that. Oh, no worries. Uh, yeah. No problem. Any time. Are you okay? Yeah, fine. Should probably get out now. I sink down and come up treading water and blinking the sea from my eyes. Mr Howie, you get funny sometimes when you talk to me. D do I? I didn't notice. She smiles again and I curse myself for feeling the blush starting in my cheeks. She notices and laughs with delight and the sudden realisation. Don't laugh, I groan. You're blushing. It's sweet. I'm not blushing, it's the sun. Oh, OK, Mr Howie. She laughs again. It's just Howie. Everyone calls you Mr. Howie. I know, right? Bloody Dave started that off. I can't call you Howie. It'll be weird in front of the others. Well, just when we're alone, then. Alone? She raises her eyebrows and smiles as my cheeks burn from the even deeper blush I can feel spreading across my face. Ah, oh, bollocks, you know what I meant. Stop teasing me. You're right, boss. Your face is very red, Clarence says as he swims over. Uh, yeah, it's the sun, and I'm, uh, knackered. Time to get out, I think. As I swim away, the surreal nature of it all hits me again. Tiny nuances of conversation, slight inflections of voice, a raised eyebrow. It's all part of our confused existence. Give me zombies to kill any day. Dave's got it right. Ignore anything that you don't understand. A few minutes later, we're all dressed in clean clothes and leaving our filthy garments in a pile on the sand. Lani leads us from the beach, having made Clarence hold the towel out for her again, and I'm grateful that she's out of that bikini and into normal clothes. We start walking up the long pier, the lads joking around for the first few minutes until the tiredness creeps back in and we walk in silence. At the end, Lani leads us through the ferry terminal buildings to a cafe with one huge glass wall, giving an amazing view of the bay and the town. And better still, we can see the length of the pier. I split the group up, and we search the buildings and rooms before gathering back in the warm room. Blowers and Cookie return with armfuls of big, heavy winter coats used by the ferry and pier staff. Heavy benches are stacked against the double doors, and we finally start settling down. Dave offers to take the first watch and promises to wake me after an hour. Too tired to protest, I rest my head on my backpack and stretch my weary limbs out, resting on one of the big jackets. A backpack drops down near to my head, followed by Lani, kneeling down to smooth out a couple of jackets. There's plenty of space here, and I wonder for a brief second why she's chosen to lie down so close. My eyes start to droop as I ponder the need people have for closeness and contact. A lone female amongst a group of men she barely knows, terrified and having lost everyone she knew in a world that's changed to become instantly dangerous. No wonder she wants to be near someone. Someone she senses she can trust. As my eyes close and sleep starts to pull me under, I feel a small hand touching mine. I open my palm and our fingers entwine. Gripping hard for a second, I squeeze back, letting her know it will be okay. Then, I'm gone. Thank you for listening to The Undead Part 4, Day 8 to Day 9 by R. R. Haywood, read by Dan Morgan. Keep listening for the first chapter of the next book in the series, The Undead Part 5, Day 10 by R. R. Haywood, read 
by Dan Morgan. The Undead, Part 5, Day 10, by R. R. Haywood. Read by Dan Morgan. The Story So Far After the battle at the fort on the seventh day, Howie led his group to the Isle of Wight to save the children from the twisted and deranged Darren and Marcy. Two days of constant fighting, running and outwitting the undead, and a final shot fired by Dave from an impossible distance saw Darren cut down. Exhausted and drained to the point of collapse, they found food and clothes before swimming in the warm sea to wash the blood and filth from their bodies. Refuge was found at the end of a long pier, and in the cafe they laid down to take the rest and sleep they so desperately craved. A new day starts, but this new world is dangerous, and every action and decision made can lead to devastating consequences, and not just for Howie and his group. The Undead continues. 1. Day 10. Sunday. Laying on his back and resting on his elbows, Nick squints from the strong sunshine pouring through the plate glass windows of the cafe at the top of the long pier. Bathed in sweat, he exhales slowly and looks over to the sleeping form of Blowers, Amazed at how within the 30 seconds since he nudged him awake to take his turn on watch, he's managed to get to his makeshift bed and drift off. With the lure of sleep threatening to pull him back under, Nick reluctantly sits up and stretches his hands down to his feet. His hamstrings feel tight, his back muscles feel tight, his arms and just about every muscle in his body feel tight. With a low groan, he clambers to his feet and stands with that sleepy fug hanging on his face for long seconds before rubbing his eyes and stretching his arms out to the sides. The last two days have been relentless. Running, fighting, hardly any sleep, crap food, the risk of death at every point, and then Lani making them sprint up that bloody hill too. Remembering the hill sprint, Nick tenses his thigh muscles and winces at the onset of pain already starting to spread through the deep muscle. With a yawn, he twists round and visually checks the sleeping forms around him. Clarence's huge bulk flat on his back and snoring away like a walrus with a sinus problem. Blowers and Cookie, like he was just a minute ago, are both sound asleep. Dave, as in his wakeful hours, sleeps quietly on his back with his hands crossed over his chest. Two knives, one either side of his bedding, rest on the floor, ready to be gripped and used. Nick notices that Dave has positioned himself between Howie and the entrance. Anything that enters must go through him first. Tom, the new lad, curled up on his side, facing away from him, but he can tell from the steady rise and fall of his upper body that he sleeps soundly. Nick was unsure about Tom and Stephen to start off with, afraid somehow that the bond they had built up between them would be weakened. Stephen was lost in the church fight, and that's something Tom will have to deal with, just as Nick had to when they lost Tucker, Curtis and Jamie. Finally, his eyes come to rest on the prone figures of Howie and Lani, sleeping close together, and Nick notices their hands are entwined. The sight of them lying hand in hand invokes a sudden feeling of unity, closeness, family. The fractured society of broken family values saw Nick, as with many young men of his age, grow up without a role model, without that alpha male to guide them and see them through the hard times. In his school days, Nick had Miss Rachel, his special needs teacher, an immensely passionate woman who taught Nick that just because he couldn't read or write that he wasn't useless, that he was still a person with values and a voice. The tuition was close and exceptions made, the use of her first name instead of surname helping bridge that gap between teacher and student. It was Miss Rachel that encouraged Nick to develop his love of anything electrical and mechanical. Miss Rachel would even bring broken things in and ask Nick to see if he could fix them, but only after he'd tried a few minutes of reading out loud. With her steadying influence and the patience she showed, Nick developed as a person and saw that maybe he wasn't just destined to get labouring work here and there. But when the school years ended... Nick struggled with the day-to-day -day life without that support and quickly became one of the many young men attending the job centre to sign on. It was the scheme to earn extra benefit and join the Territorial Army that saved his life. 
He remembers holding the pen over the form and trying to decide if he should sign up and thinking back to the kindness that Miss Rachel showed him and knowing this was his chance to do something different. Meeting the other lads, and then, ultimately, Howie, gave him something he hadn't experienced before. A life. A belonging. His skills had already been used several times, and not one of them judged his inability. He'd stood on the line with these men, in the most utterly terrifying of situations, but Nick wouldn't change any of it. Howie fills that role as a mentor, leader, and a father figure of immeasurable kindness. Brave isn't a strong enough word for how Nick regards Howie. His ability and never-failing courage. Howie would willingly give his life for any one of them to have the chance for survival. That intense look in his eyes and that quiet, dark, brooding nature. The fire burning away in his soul that drives them on to do things Nick never thought possible. Nick fancied Lani when she came into the group. They all did. The beautiful Thai girl became part of them within a few hours and already Nick couldn't imagine her not being there. She fought bravely with strength and courage, never failing to take her turn. Now, watching her lie hand in hand with Howie fills Nick with a sense of something. Something he can't explain. Just that it's right. That's all. He quietly opens the rear door leading out onto the outside decking area. The air outside is cooler than the humidity of the enclosed room, so he wedges the door open with a patio chair and scans the view. Thick black smoke still plumes from the church fire deep in the town, smaller wisps of smoke spiralling up from the long row of burnt-out houses along the seafront. The rest looks serene and peaceful. Golden beaches with the blue waters gently lapping at the shore. The houses look clean and homely. He turns slowly, soaking in the view, while he pulls a battered packet of cigarettes from his pocket and taps one out. Despite the air being still... He still cups the flame of the lighter and inhales the smoke into his lungs, feeling the rough bite in his dry throat and coughing gently. Exhaling the smoke, he looks out following the shoreline to the harbour in the distance and the long line of dark objects moving slowly into the sea. It takes him several seconds of staring dully to realise what he's seeing. Boats moving away from the harbour. Lots of boats. His heart quickens and his face lights up with the excitement of seeing their group getting safely away from the island. He throws the cigarette into the waters below and runs back inside, calling out and watching as sleepy forms become suddenly awake forms, leaping to their feet and grabbing weapons to slay whatever foe that has dared to disturb them. The boats! (laughs) Nick coughs, his voice as yet unused since he woke up. Boats from the harbour! He points to the windows. The group hastily move out onto the decking and lean against the railing, watching with smiles and low cheers at the flotilla of vessels moving safely away. Dean kept his word then. Clarence stretches his mighty arms and leans his bulk against the railing, which creaks in response. He did, Howie nods with a huge grin. He bloody did. Well done, Nick. Good spot, mate, Howie grins at the young lad. The others turn to smile and clap him on the shoulders, like it was Nick's own work that got them away safely. Does that mean we get the day off, Mr Howie? Cookie asks with a mischievous grin. Well, I don't know about that, Howie replies, scratching his head. But maybe a few hours to relax before we move off. What's the time? Just gone two, Nick replies, checking his watch. I'm bloody starving. Again? We only just had food, you gutsy bugger. Blowers says. That was hours ago, Nick replies as he lights another cigarette and hands the pack round. Standing there and with the first good news in days, they relax against the barrier, lounging in patio chairs and reliving the night's events. Tom, how are you, mate? Howie asks after nodding to the young policeman. I'm good, Mr Howie, Tom nods back quietly. Listen, I'm sorry about Stephen. He was a good lad and it was bad the way he went like that. Howie speaks gently, knowing Tom saw him fire his pistol into Stephen's head as he lay dying. The injuries were too bad for survival, and Howie couldn't risk another Darren coming back. I know you had to do it. Tom looks back into the dark eyes of Howie, holding his gaze for seconds and showing that he understands. For what it's worth, mate, I'm glad you came with us. You fought well, Tom, and I don't know how we would have got through it without you. Howie meant the words too. Tom had fought well, 
And even when Stephen fell, he didn't allow himself to falter, but pushed on with the same savage ferocity as the rest of them. Mr Howie, Tom asks with a sudden puzzled expression, last night when you pushed forward into the tower stairwell, how did you do that? He stares hard into Howie's face, watching the sudden dark look creep into his eyes. That power, that hard stare. I don't know, mate. Howie replies suddenly with a wry smile. It just sort of happens. Happens? What, you mean you've done that before? Tom asks. He, along with the rest, stood and watched in rapture as Howie took the front position during the desperate battle to hold the stairs. When they were being beaten back and losing more ground than ever, before Howie changed. His whole manner and being became fluid. Not like Dave, the way he moves like a dancer with grace and agility, but something else. A power poured from Howie, and it was like the undead just fell before him. Every strike was where it should have been. Every step saw them wilt and fall away from him. An electric feeling passed through all of them, and Tom felt the hairs on the back of his neck standing up, witnessing something extraordinary. Aha, <laughs> you can tell you're a copper, Tom. Howie smiles awkwardly. I don't know, mate, it just happens. Uh, right, there must be some coffee around here somewhere. Fancy one, mate? How he deflects the question, and his easy smile means no offence is taken. The rules have changed, and whereas just a few days ago, Tom would have stood his ground and questioned the man regarding his ability, now he was just glad to be with him. Glad to be with all of them. What he saw during that night was a unity that even the police never matched. The way they watched each other, pulling each other back and covering the weak points. Tom heard them say they were used to fighting alongside each other, and now he understands what that means. The easy jokes, the banter, and the ready smiles they keep flashing even when they were so massively outnumbered. Dave, the small, quiet man that Tom and Stephen already held in awe, taking on the role of sergeant to Howie's officer. Blowers like a corporal, stepping in to take the lead whenever needed. Oi, Tom, you fancy a smoke, mate? Cookie calls out. Tom turns to look at the group seated round a large table, blowers motioning to an empty chair in the middle of them, Lani already seated and smiling from a comment made by Nick. A small gesture, but one of great meaning. An acceptance into the group, and with a quick smile of his own, he walked forward to sit amongst them. Blowers watches Tom speaking as Cookie goes to sit down in the chair next to him. Blowers blocks the seat quietly and gets a puzzled look from Cookie in return. He nods to Tom, indicating the chair is for him. Cookie nods in understanding and takes the next one alone. He did well, Cookie says quietly. Yeah, shame about Stephen, Blowers replies. Shame about all of them, Cookie says with a sad look at his friend. What now? Eh? Blowers snaps his mind back to the present. What now, Cookie repeats. Back to the fort? Probably, Blowers nods. Okay. Cookie says softly. What? Blowers picks up on the tone of his normally jovial friend. Nothing, Cookie hesitates. Oh, I don't know, I just kind of like this. How do you mean? Blowers asks. Us, you know, just us lot being on the road and doing stuff together. Shit, it sounds weird like that. I'm not saying I like it, like the whole end of the world thing, but, you know, being together like this. Feels safer? Nick cuts in, leaning across Lani, sat next to him. Yeah, like we know what we're doing. Shit, it doesn't make sense when I say it, but I know what I mean in my head. Cookie screws his face up in concentration. It's like, well, his voice drops along with his gaze, which stays fixed to his boots. Family or something, he mumbles, expecting a torrent of abuse from Blowers and Nick. He feels the first flush of shame burning his face. Me too. Nick adds quietly, with his own uncomfortable shuffle in the patio chair. I wish Tucker was here and Jamie and Curtis. Especially Tucker. I miss his food. Lani smiles with sadness at the lads around her. She can feel the close bond between them. And from what they said, there was quite a few before the big battle at the fort they came from. Now down to three, but they protect each other like brothers under the watchful eye of Howie. Oh, the best... Cookie adds in a muted tone. Oi, Tom, do you fancy a smoke, mate? He calls out, seeing Howie move back inside, and Tom left standing alone. I don't smoke, 
Tom smiles and moves over to the chair nodded at by blowers. Thanks for asking me though, mate. No worries. So you're a copper then. How long were you in for? Cookie asks with a genuinely interested look. That must have been a hard job, Nick asks before he can answer. I'd have loved to have been a policeman. Why didn't you join up then? Tom asks. Can't read or write. Nick shrugs with a smile to show he's over any form of embarrassment about it. Really? Lani asks in surprise. Yeah, severe dyslexia and, well, I just didn't really bother at school. He's bloody good at electrical stuff, though, Cookie cuts in, keen to defend his friend from any shame. He got Tower Bridge in London all rigged up. Do you remember that? He laughs at Blowers. Jesus, that was brilliant. Blowers laughs at the memory, watching Nick smile sheepishly. The bridge splits in two, right? So we had this massive horde coming at us, and we were getting pinned down. So Nick here, he goes into the control room and gets the thing working. Blowers breaks off, laughing hard, more so because of Cookie starting to crack up. He gets one end going up and down like this. He imitates the bridge with one forearm. And this horde were coming over it, so Nick waits until they get there, and whoosh, he lifts it up and they go flying. Then he drops it down and waits for them to all stack up against the end of the other bit, and whoosh, it goes up again. Funniest thing you ever saw. And he got the petrol pumps going at that garage, Cookie says, wiping tears of laughter away. Ah, those rats, Nick shudders. Nasty. You remember that bloke on the roof? Oh, that was bloody funny too. We drove off with his trousers on the Saxon. Blowers starts off again as Cookie bends over with his stomach hurting from laughing. Lani and Tom laugh as Blowers launches into a descriptive replay of the memory. Jesus, Tom says after gaining control of his laughter. You've done some things, you lot. We have, Nick nods slowly. We'd have been dead many times though if it weren't for Mr Howie and Dave. That roof we were saying about, Blowers cuts in. Well. Mr Howie got isolated on his own downstairs. We were surrounded and it didn't look good. Rats and zombie filth everywhere. The Saxon was out in the car park with the big machine gun on the top. So Mr Howie decides, on his own, to charge the lot of them and make it to the Saxon so he can cut them down and save us. Dave, though, Cookie takes over. Dave thought the same thing and wanted to save Mr Howie. He leans in, speaking quieter. He ditched his guns and screamed, Blowers, you're in charge, and launches himself off the roof straight into the lot of them. Only had his knives, he did. He leans back, shaking his head in wonder. Christ, Tom exclaims. So how he charged them from the bottom and Dave went from the top, and they didn't know what the other one was doing. No, mate, they both figured one of them had to survive to protect us and get to Mr Howie's sister. Fuck, Tom whispers. Last night when he did that thing, you know, going at them like that. So he's done that before then. Yeah, a few times, Blowers answers, looking uncomfortable. Tom picks up on the slight shift in position and the quiet looks between Blowers, Cookie and Nick. What? Tom asks, unable to restrain the instinctive policeman habit of asking questions. Nothing. Nick shrugs and lights another cigarette. No, Nick, what? Lani presses the question home, having also picked up on the subtle looks between the three lads. I don't know, that fight outside the fort, he, well, Mr Howie, he sort of did something weird and... What? Tom asked quietly, and could see them now over-shifting and fumbling between the lads now. Well, he got beat down, Cookie explains. We all saw it. He looks to Blowers and Nick, both nodding in confirmation. We were fucked. I mean, completely fucked. We were getting slaughtered and there were so many of them. I think Curtis went down first, maybe Tucker. I don't know anyway. We were losing, badly. Mr Howie gets beaten down and we knew we'd lost it. We'd given them a bloody good hiding, but it was over. His voice trails off, the vivid memory playing through his mind. The sounds of screaming and the constant growling and roar of the undead as they press the attack again and again the smell of blood and guts being spilled, the fear and the exhaustion. He was on his knees. Nick picks the tail up with a distant look. Mr Howie on his knees, crying. He kept trying to get back up, but he was done for. Dave was off somewhere and the rest of us were getting the shit beaten out of us. We all saw it. 
Nick suddenly looks up at Blowers and speaks with a firmer tone, like he wants confirmation too before he carries on. Mr. Howie was down, but then he changed. He started praying to himself and then got back up. His face... Nick shakes his head. His face was... It was different, Blowers cuts in. He got back up and he was saying the Lord's Prayer. His voice got strong, so loud, and we all heard it. Were you close to him then? Tom probes for the details. No, I mean we all heard it. Everyone on that field heard it. Every man fighting heard that prayer coming from him. We all took it up, and seeing him rise up, he was like a Viking warrior or something from a movie. They wouldn't go for him, like they were scared or something. Mr Howie, he just stood there, and they cowered back. Then he went for it. Like last night? Tom asked. Yeah, like last night, Blowers replies. Him and Dave were something else, relentless, ruthless. And Clarence, mate, he is so bloody strong. Yeah, I watched him, Tom replied. This is Audible. The Undead, Part 5, Day 10, by R. R. Haywood. Read by Dan Morgan. The Story So Far After the battle at the fort on the seventh day, Howie led his group to the Isle of Wight to save the children from the twisted and deranged Darren and Marcy. Two days of constant fighting, running and outwitting the undead, and a final shot fired by Dave from an impossible distance saw Darren cut down. Exhausted and drained to the point of collapse, they found food and clothes before swimming in the warm sea to wash the blood and filth from their bodies. Refuge was found at the end of a long pier, and in the cafe they laid down to take the rest and sleep they so desperately craved. A new day starts, but this new world is dangerous, and every action and decision made can lead to devastating consequences, and not just for Howie and his group. The Undead continues. 1. Day 10. Sunday. Laying on his back and resting on his elbows, Nick squints from the strong sunshine pouring through the plate glass windows of the cafe at the top of the long pier. Bathed in sweat, he exhales slowly and looks over to the sleeping form of Blowers, amazed at how within the 30 seconds since he nudged him awake to take his turn on watch, he's managed to get to his makeshift bed and drift off. With the lure of sleep threatening to pull him back under, Nick reluctantly sits up and stretches his hands down to his feet. His hamstrings feel tight, his back muscles feel tight, his arms and just about every muscle in his body feel tight. With a low groan, he clambers to his feet and stands with that sleepy fug hanging on his face for long seconds before rubbing his eyes and stretching his arms out to the sides. The last two days have been relentless. Running, fighting, hardly any sleep, crap food, the risk of death at every point, and then Lani making them sprint up that bloody hill too. Remembering the hill sprint, Nick tenses his thigh muscles and winces at the onset of pain already starting to spread through the deep muscle. With a yawn, he twists round and visually checks the sleeping forms around him. Clarence's huge bulk flat on his back and snoring away like a walrus with a sinus problem. Blowers and Cookie, like he was just a minute ago, are both sound asleep. Dave, as in his wakeful hours, sleeps quietly on his back with his hands crossed over his chest. Two knives, one either side of his bedding, rest on the floor ready to be gripped and used. Nick notices that Dave has positioned himself between Howie and the entrance. Anything that enters must go through him first. Tom, the new lad, curled up on his side facing away from him, but he can tell from the steady rise and fall of his upper body that he sleeps soundly. Nick was unsure about Tom and Stephen to start off with, afraid somehow that the bond they had built up between them would be weakened. Stephen was lost in the church fight, and that's something Tom will have to deal with, just as Nick had to when they lost Tucker, Curtis and Jamie. Finally, his eyes come to rest on the prone figures of Howie and Lani, sleeping close together, and Nick notices their hands are entwined. 
The sight of them lying hand in hand invokes a sudden feeling of unity, closeness, family. The fractured society of broken family values saw Nick, as with many young men of his age, grow up without a role model, without that alpha male to guide them and see them through the hard times. In his school days, Nick had Miss Rachel, his special needs teacher, an immensely passionate woman who taught Nick that just because he couldn't read or write, that he wasn't useless, that he was still a person with values and a voice. The tuition was close and exceptions made, the use of her first name instead of surname helping bridge that gap between teacher and student. It was Miss Rachel that encouraged Nick to develop his love of anything electrical and mechanical. Miss Rachel would even bring broken things in and ask Nick to see if he could fix them, but only after he'd tried a few minutes of reading out loud. With her steadying influence and the patience she showed, Nick developed as a person and saw that maybe he wasn't just destined to get labouring work here and there. But when the school years ended, Nick struggled with the day-to-day -day life without that support and quickly became one of the many young men attending the job centre to sign on. It was the scheme to earn extra benefit and join the Territorial Army that saved his life. He remembers holding the pen over the form and trying to decide if he should sign up and thinking back to the kindness that Miss Rachel showed him and knowing this was his chance to do something different. Meeting the other lads, and then, ultimately, Howie, gave him something he hadn't experienced before. A life. A belonging. His skills had already been used several times and not one of them judged his inability. He'd stood on the line with these men in the most utterly terrifying of situations, but Nick wouldn't change any of it. Howie fills that role as a mentor, leader and a father figure of immeasurable kindness. Brave isn't a strong enough word for how Nick regards Howie, his ability and never-failing courage. Howie would willingly give his life for any one of them to have the chance for survival. That intense look in his eyes and that quiet, dark, brooding nature – the fire burning away in his soul that drives them on to do things Nick never thought possible. Nick fancied Lani when she came into the group. They all did. The beautiful Thai girl became part of them within a few hours, and already Nick couldn't imagine her not being there. She fought bravely with strength and courage, never failing to take her turn. Now, watching her lie hand in hand with Howie fills Nick with a sense of something. Something he can't explain. Just that it's right. That's all. He quietly opens the rear door leading out onto the outside decking area. The air outside is cooler than the humidity of the enclosed room, so he wedges the door open with a patio chair and scans the view. Thick black smoke still plumes from the church fire deep in the town, smaller wisps of smoke spiralling up from the long row of burnt-out houses along the seafront. The rest looks serene and peaceful. Golden beaches with the blue waters gently lapping at the shore, the houses look clean and homely. He turns slowly, soaking in the view, while he pulls a battered packet of cigarettes from his pocket and taps one out. Despite the air being still, he still cups the flame of the lighter and inhales the smoke into his lungs, feeling the rough bite in his dry throat and coughing gently. Exhaling the smoke, he looks out following the shoreline to the harbour in the distance and the long line of dark objects moving slowly into the sea. It takes him several seconds of staring dully to realise what he's seeing. Boats moving away from the harbour. Lots of boats. His heart quickens and his face lights up with the excitement of seeing their group getting safely away from the island. He throws the cigarette into the waters below and runs back inside, calling out and watching as sleepy forms become suddenly awake forms, leaping to their feet and grabbing weapons to slay whatever foe that has dared to disturb them. The boats! <laughs> Nick coughs, his voice as yet unused since he woke up. Boats from the harbour! He points to the windows. The group hastily move out onto the decking and lean against the railing, watching with smiles and low cheers at the flotilla of vessels moving safely away. Dean kept his word then. Clarence stretches his mighty arms and leans his bulk against the railing, which creaks in response. He did. Howie nods with a huge grin. He bloody did. Well done, Nick. Good spot, mate. Howie grins at the young lad. The others turn to smile and clap him on the shoulders, like it was Nick's own work that got them away safely. Does that mean we get the day off, Mr Howie? Cookie asks with a mischievous grin. 
Well, I don't know about that, Howie replies, scratching his head. But maybe a few hours to relax before we move off. What's the time? Just gone two, Nick replies, checking his watch. I'm bloody starving. Again? We only just had food, you gutsy bugger, Blowers says. That was hours ago, Nick replies as he lights another cigarette and hands the pack round. Standing there and with the first good news in days, they relax against the barrier, lounging in patio chairs and reliving the night's events. Tom, how are you, mate? Howie asks after nodding to the young policeman. I'm good, Mr Howie. Tom nods back quietly. Listen, I'm sorry about Stephen. He was a good lad and it was bad the way he went like that. Howie speaks gently, knowing Tom saw him fire his pistol into Stephen's head as he lay dying. The injuries were too bad for survival and Howie couldn't risk another Darren coming back. I know you had to do it. Tom looks back into the dark eyes of Howie, holding his gaze for seconds and showing that he understands. For what it's worth, mate, I'm glad you came with us. You fought well, Tom, and I don't know how we would have got through it without you. Howie meant the words too. Tom had fought well, and even when Stephen fell, he didn't allow himself to falter, but pushed on with the same savage ferocity as the rest of them. Mr Howie... Tom asks with a sudden puzzled expression. Last night when you pushed forward into the tower stairwell, how did you do that? He stares hard into Howie's face, watching the sudden dark look creep into his eyes. That power, that hard stare. I don't know, mate, Howie replies suddenly with a wry smile. It just sort of happens. Happens? What, you mean you've done that before? Tom asks. He, along with the rest, stood and watched in rapture as Howie took the front position during the desperate battle to hold the stairs, when they were being beaten back and losing more ground than ever, before Howie changed. His whole manner and being became fluid, not like Dave, the way he moves like a dancer with grace and agility, but something else. A power poured from Howie, and it was like the undead just fell before him. Every strike was where it should have been, Every step saw them wilt and fall away from him. An electric feeling passed through all of them and Tom felt the hairs on the back of his neck standing up, witnessing something extraordinary. Aha, you can tell you're a copper, Tom. Howie smiles awkwardly. I don't know, mate, it just happens. Uh, Right, there must be some coffee around here somewhere. Fancy one, mate? Howie deflects the question. And his easy smile means no offence is taken. The rules have changed, and whereas just a few days ago, Tom would have stood his ground and questioned the man regarding his ability, now he was just glad to be with him. Glad to be with all of them. What he saw during that night was a unity that even the police never matched. The way they watched each other, pulling each other back and covering the weak points. Tom heard them say they were used to fighting alongside each other, and now he understands what that means. The easy jokes, the banter and the ready smiles they keep flashing even when they were so massively outnumbered. Dave, the small, quiet man that Tom and Stephen already held in awe, taking on the role of sergeant to Howie's officer. Blowers like a corporal, stepping in to take the lead whenever needed. Oi, Tom, you fancy a smoke, mate? Cookie calls out. Tom turns to look at the group seated round a large table, Blowers motioning to an empty chair in the middle of them. Lani already seated and smiling from a comment made by Nick. A small gesture, but one of great meaning. An acceptance into the group, and with a quick smile of his own, he walked forward to sit amongst them. Blowers watches Tom speaking as Cookie goes to sit down in the chair next to him. Blowers blocks the seat quietly and gets a puzzled look from Cookie in return. He nods to Tom, indicating the chair is for him. Cookie nods in understanding, and takes the next one alone. He did well, Cookie says quietly. Yeah, shame about Stephen. Blowers replies. Shame about all of them, Cookie says with a sad look at his friend. What now? Eh? Blowers snaps his mind back to the present. What now? Cookie repeats. Back to the fort? Probably, Blowers nods. Okay, Cookie says softly. What? Blowers picks up on the tone of his normally jovial friend. Nothing, Cookie hesitates. I don't know, I just kind of like this. How do you mean? Blowers asks. Us, you know, just us lot being on the road and doing stuff together. Shit, sounds weird like that. 
I'm not saying I like it, like the whole end of the world thing, but, you know, being together like this. Feel safer? Nick cuts in, leaning across Lani, sat next to him. Yeah, like we know what we're doing. Shit, it doesn't make sense when I say it, but I know what I'm in in my head. Cookie screws his face up in concentration. It's like, well, his voice drops along with his gaze, which stays fixed to his boots. Family or something, he mumbles, expecting a torrent of abuse from Blowers and Nick. He feels the first flush of shame burning his face. Me too, Nick adds quietly, with his own uncomfortable shuffle in the patio chair. I wish Tucker was here and Jamie and Curtis. Especially Tucker. I miss his food. Lani smiles with sadness at the lads around her. She can feel the close bond between them. And from what they said, there was quite a few before the big battle at the fort they came from. Now down to three, but they protect each other like brothers under the watchful eye of Howie. Oh, the best, Cookie adds in a muted tone. Oi, Tom, do you fancy a smoke, mate? He calls out, seeing Howie move back inside, and Tom left standing alone. I don't smoke, Tom smiles, and moves over to the chair nodded at by blowers. Thanks for asking me though, mate. No worries. So you're a copper then. How long were you in for? Cookie asks with a genuinely interested look. That must have been a hard job, Nick asks before he can answer. I'd have loved to have been a policeman. Why didn't you join up then? Tom asks. Can't read or write, Nick shrugs with a smile to show he's over any form of embarrassment about it. Really? Lani asks in surprise. Yeah, severe dyslexia and, well, I just didn't really bother at school. He's bloody good at electrical stuff, though, Cookie cuts in, keen to defend his friend from any shame. He got Tower Bridge in London all rigged up. Do you remember that? He laughs at blowers. Jesus, that was brilliant. Blowers laughs at the memory, watching Nick smile sheepishly. The bridge splits in two, right? So we had this massive horde coming at us, and we were getting pinned down. So Nick here, he goes into the control room and gets the thing working. Blowers breaks off, laughing hard, more so because of Cookie starting to crack up. He gets one end going up and down like this. He imitates the bridge with one forearm. And this horde were coming over it, so Nick waits until they get there, and whoosh, he lifts it up, and they go flying. Then he drops it down and waits for them to all stack up against the end of the other bit and whoosh, it goes up again. Funniest thing you ever saw. And he got the petrol pumps going at that garage, Cookie says, wiping tears of laughter away. Ah, those rats, Nick shudders. Nasty. You remember that bloke on the roof? Oh, that was bloody funny too. We drove off with his trousers on the Saxon. Blowers starts off again as Cookie bends over with his stomach hurting from laughing. Lani and Tom laugh as Blowers launches into a descriptive replay of the memory. Jesus, Tom says after gaining control of his laughter. You've done some things, you lot. We have, Nick nods slowly. We'd have been dead many times, though, if it weren't for Mr Howie and Dave. That roof we were saying about, Blowers cuts in. Well, Mr Howie got isolated on his own downstairs. We were surrounded and it didn't look good. Rats and zombie filth everywhere. The Saxon was out in the car park with the big machine gun on the top. So Mr Howie decides, on his own, to charge the lot of them and make it to the Saxon so he can cut them down and save us. Dave, though, Cookie takes over. Dave thought the same thing and wanted to save Mr Howie. He leans in, speaking quieter. He ditched his guns and screamed, Blowers, you're in charge, and launches himself off the roof straight into the lot of them. Only had his knives, he did. He leans back, shaking his head in wonder. Christ, Tom exclaims. So how he charged them from the bottom and Dave went from the top. They didn't know what the other one was doing. No, mate. They both figured one of them had to survive to protect us and get to Mr Howie's sister. Fuck, Tom whispers. Last night when he did that thing, you know, going at them like that. So he's done that before then. Yeah, a few times. Blower's answers, looking uncomfortable. Tom picks up on the slight shift in position and the quiet looks between Blower's, Cookie and Nick. What? Tom asks, unable to restrain the instinctive policeman habit of asking questions. Nothing. Nick shrugs and lights another cigarette. No, Nick, what? 
Lani presses the question home, having also picked up on the subtle looks between the three lads. I don't know, that fight outside the fort, he, well, Mr Howie, he sort of did something weird and... What? Tom asked quietly and could see them now over-shifting and fumbling between the lads now. Well, he got beat down, Cookie explains. We all saw it. He looks to Blowers and Nick, both nodding in confirmation. We were fucked. I mean, completely fucked. We were getting slaughtered and there were so many of them. I think Curtis went down first, maybe Tucker. I don't know anyway. We were losing badly. Mr Howie gets beaten down and we knew we'd lost it. We'd given them a bloody good hiding, but it was over. His voice trails off, the vivid memory playing through his mind. The sounds of screaming and the constant growling and roar of the undead as they press the attack again and again. The smell of blood and guts being spilled. The fear and the exhaustion. He was on his knees. Nick picks the tail up with a distant look. Mr Howie on his knees, crying. He kept trying to get back up, but he was done for. Dave was off somewhere and the rest of us were getting the shit beaten out of us. We all saw it. Nick suddenly looks up at Blowers and speaks with a firmer tone, like he wants confirmation too before he carries on. Mr Howie was down, but then he changed. He started praying to himself and then got back up. His face... Nick shakes his head. His face was... It was different. Blowers cuts in. He got back up and he was saying the Lord's Prayer. His voice got strong, so loud, and we all heard it. Were you close to him then? Tom probes for the details. No, I mean we all heard it. Everyone on that field heard it. Every man fighting heard that prayer coming from him. We all took it up and seeing him rise up, he was like a Viking warrior or something from a movie. They wouldn't go for him, like they were scared or something. Mr Howie, he just stood there, and they cowered back. Then he went for it. Like last night? Tom asked. Yeah, like last night, Blowers replies. Him and Dave were something else, relentless, ruthless. And Clarence, mate, he is so bloody strong. Yeah, I watched him, Tom replied. Lani listens intently as the stories are relayed, the lads giving the funny and heartbreaking accounts of their time together. Like the others, she gets that tingling hair-on-the-back-of-the-neck feeling at the memories of the big fight retold. That quiet and softly spoken man with the easy smile, holding her hand when he could have easily pulled away or shifted position. She saw his discomfort when they were swimming this morning, how his face blushed when she made the joke about calling him Howie when they were alone. That same quiet man who held a field of undead at bay with a dangerous glint in his eye. Her family came from Thailand when she was very young, moving to a strange country that was so wealthy but with such fractured family values. Her own family kept them close and raised her with discipline and love. Nurturing where parents should, guiding and proving that hard work and dedication paid off. She knew her parents had to work so hard to get anything for those first few years, dealing with the stereotypes and prejudice of a mainly white population. Her own strong mix of conflicting values meant she often felt neither here nor there, isolated from her traditions of her country, but still not a complete part of the local society. The utter terror of being left alone for those long days and longer nights, hearing the undead howling as the sun went down, and knowing her family and friends were all taken, that they would kill her without remorse if she got caught. She spent days sobbing and crying, hiding in fear as she grew filthier and more hungry. Then, when she couldn't take it any more, she went out to find them. Going to her friend's house and finding him turned, she got trapped, and where she thought she would freeze in fear, she didn't. She fought back and killed. Then killed more as she battled her way out of the building. The adrenaline surge left her shaking and trembling from head to toe, but in that instant she changed. A switch had been clicked inside her. She no longer cried, and although she still felt the same fear, it was coupled with a burning rage and desire for revenge. She became cunning, 
and when she saw her hiding place had been smashed and entered while she was away, she knew that if she fixed it, the people would see and come back. But knowing they had already entered and found nothing, she figured it would now be the safest place. Then, when Howie and Nick came in, she heard the movements and thought they were the undead. Going out to exact that vengeance, she froze on seeing two armed men standing just feet in front of her, and inwardly cursed her own stupidity. Lani's mind was resolute and firm. She knew men found her beautiful, an exotic difference from the mostly pale, taller girls of the country. She also knew that men would try and take that beauty if they found her. She decided that if that happened, she would fight to the death. But suddenly, seeing two men there, armed with guns, hard stares and dressed like mercenaries, she didn't feel so brave. Lani watched them speaking. She took in the friendly tone how he used and the way he backed off and told Nick to do the same. As they went to leave, her instinct told her to go after them and take the chance. She did. And now looking back, perhaps that split-second decision has given her the best chance for survival. Who knows what will happen? She may die any minute. Any one of them could. But here with these men, she knows she stands the strongest possibility of living. Howie and the way he gets nervous round her when they're alone... He's sweet, and something inside her is drawn to him in a way she hasn't felt before. Strange times, though, and strange behaviours. She felt foolish when they woke, for having the need to hold his hand and showing a weakness. But now, sitting amongst these people and feeling secure for the first time since this began, she relaxes and enjoys the sunlight, but still glances frequently into the cafe to watch the man with the curly dark hair. He's mid-conversation with Dave and Clarence, he turns, smiles, she feels her heart skip a beat, and she smiles back, then chuckles softly at seeing his blush, even from this distance. Inside the cafe, Clarence and Dave stand together with Howie, making plans while drinking warm water from bottles left in their packs. I'm just saying I think they need a few hours to unwind, boss. It's been relentless the last few days. They're young, and they've done everything you've asked of them. Clarence rumbles in a conversational tone. Yeah, I guess so, Howie nods back. The urge to press on burns inside, but where to? He has accomplished what he set out to do, saved Sarah, dealt with the threats along the way, and got the women and children from the fort safely back across the water. There could be threats on the other side waiting for them, but as Sarah and Sergeant Hopewell repeatedly said, they have to be able to take care of themselves, and the sea captain will probably take them straight to the back of the fort too. The constant pace... The sheer desperation of each day, and now, with what he can only think of as downtime, he feels twitchy and like there should be another mission, another task waiting. Let's get some coffee going and see what food we can find, Clarence adds. Even he feels tired after the night's ferocious fighting. He'd happily push on without complaint if the need arose, but he also knows, after many years' service, that taking time to unwind is as important as anything else in times of extreme combat and stress. Clarence chose to come with Howie knowing they would need good, experienced fighters in order to stand the best chance of getting to the women and children, and of course, Sarah. At the fort, Big Chris accepted his decision and he set out intending to assist and then get back to work alongside his former comrade. However, Clarence had watched the way Howie and the lads fought together as a tight unit. The sheer courage they displayed was at times unnerving and reminded him strongly of how he, Chris and Malcolm had been when they were young and fresh recruits. After the last two days of being with them constantly, Clarence, as with the others, now felt an unbreakable bond. When he slipped from the roof climbing down from the church tower, he faced certain death from the fire raging beneath him. But those lads and Lani risked their own safety to save him, and that took something far more than courage. It was unity, comradeship, and every decent value that was drummed into him as a young soldier. Seeing how his quick reactions, his constant state of mind and ability to take information in, process it and reach a decision even in the harshest of situations had continually impressed Clarence and he felt himself slipping into calling Howie boss. A word used by soldiers towards their ranking officer when out in the field and the need for such rigid formality wasn't so important. As the two days went on, Clarence felt Howie's natural authority coming through and now he understood just why these men followed him. 
Dave, you happy with that? How he asks. He glances out the window at Lani smiling at him and feels the blush starting instantly, quickly turning back to Dave in the hope they don't notice. Yes, Mr Howie, Dave nods with a blank expression. Right, that's settled then. Chill out here for a few hours and get some rest. I'll go break the good news. He strolls out the door into the sunlight and smiles as the group turn to watch and start getting to their feet, ready to move out. Relax, Howie waves an arm at them. We're staying here for a while so we can relax and unwind. Personally, I was ready to go find another horde to piss off, but I reckon I've been outvoted, so... His voice drains away, lost in the sudden cheers erupting from everyone seated at the large table. Smiling, he gives thanks that someone like Clarence has the experience and knowledge to impart at such times. But we still need a constant watch on and keep your weapons close at all times, got it? A round of grinning affirmations come straight back. Yes, sir, and yes, Mr Howie. Shaking his head and still wondering how he came to get stuck with being called Sir and Mr Howie, he grins back and leans against the rail. We need food, though, he muses. Mr Howie, I saw some rods in the office when we searched earlier. We could have a go at catching fish, Cookie asks. If we did it from here, we could keep a watch on the pier, too. Good idea, mate. Crack on and catch us some dinner then. Nick, I need your special skills. Nick looks up with a sudden keen interest in his eye, already excited at whatever challenge awaits. Is it possible to rig that coffee machine, how he points into the room at the shiny coffee maker on the counter, to a car battery? If not, then how could we get power to it so we can brew up? There's some cars in the car park on the other side, Nick, Blowers informs him needlessly. I'm on it, Mr Howie. Just the coffee machine or anything else? Nick already on his feet and squeezing through the chairs, cigarette hanging from his mouth. Coffee first. Definitely coffee first. But see what else you can find. Ha! I'll need a hand. I'm fishing, Blowers replies quickly, relishing the prospect of a few hours idling with his feet dangling off the pier's edge. Tom, you any good with cars and stuff? Nick asks. Yeah, I'll help, mate. Tom gets up to follow Nick into the cafe. You can't smoke in there, Cookie suddenly shouts after Nick as he walks towards the counter with his cigarette in his mouth. Oh shit, I forgot. Nick turns and jogs quickly back to the open door, stopping as he realises what he's doing. You twat, Cookie, he shouts and goes back inside, making a play of puffing away while he walks through. Tom, that's illegal. You should nick him. Ah, get it? Nick him? Nick? Cookie laughs to himself, feeling not the slightest embarrassment at the stony faces refusing to humour him. Oh, well, I thought it was funny. Right, let's get them rods. He nods to blowers. The two lads setting off through the cafe, shouting abuse at Nick and Tom as they pass. A silence descends outside as Howie and Lani both realise they're alone. Nodding slowly, they both look at each other. Neither speaks. Nervous stares. Slow smiles start to form and they both burst out laughing, releasing the small tension that built up within those few seconds. So, we're alone, Howie says. You can call me Howie now. Well, in that case, you should call me Miss Lani, then. Miss Lani? Sounds like an Italian sausage. Howie laughs. (laughs) Okay, it's a deal, Miss Lani. Thank you, Howie, Lani replies with perfect politeness. So, you okay, then? Howie asks softly. Fine. Uh, thanks for last night with the hand thing. She bites her bottom lip and smiles coyly, suddenly aware that maybe she didn't need to mention it. Ah, oh, yes, uh, that's uh, uh, fine. Yeah, really, any time. Any time? She asks quickly. Well, you know, maybe not any time, but so not any time. She cocks her head to one side, watching him seriously and trying not to laugh at his nervous stuttering. Well, no, of course, any time, you know, any time you want a hand. (laughs) Ha, a hand. Uh, No, I meant that. Not a hand, like, helping you with something. Though, obviously, I can help you with things if you want. But I meant as in a hand to, uh, well, hold. Howie, she laughs. I can't believe you're so nervous around me. Oh, bloody hell, he laughs at himself. I'm always like it around beautiful women. So I'm beautiful then. She carries on with the merciless teasing, but the jokey question is clearly loaded for an answer. 
Shit, I walked into that one, didn't I? Howie grins as he runs a hand through his thick hair and drops his eyes down to the floor. Lani, you are very beautiful, he says softly and looks up with a sudden smile. Amazed at himself and that never in a million years would he dream of telling someone as beautiful as Lani that she was beautiful, simply for fear of dropping dead with embarrassment and knowing it would sound cheesy coming from him. But his polite tone and clear nerves convey the gesture with meaning instead of being corny and cliched. Lani, are you blushing now? Howie chuckles with delight at the tinge of redness in her cheeks. No, it's the sun. She grins back at him, showing her white, even teeth, laughing the blush away. She reaches up to take her hairband out and runs her fingers through her long, silky hair. Oh, the sun, is it? Okay, so it wasn't the sun. So, Howie, what task have you got for me? Eh? For you? Well, Nick and Tom are going to rig up the coffee machine. Cookie and blowers are fishing, so what? She fixes him with a steady, mischievous eye. Are you going to do with me? Oh, you can't ask it like that, Howie groans. Sorry, I feel mean for teasing you. I promise I'll never do it in front of the others, though, she says earnestly. Okay, he replies. Thank you. Uh, I've no idea. We've got to sort the kit out and see what ammunition we've got left, get some food sorted, and work out a way of getting back, I guess. Right, well, I'll come with you then. She gets up quickly as Howie gives thanks for her easy, confident manner, saving him from a certain death of stuttering like a drunk Hugh Grant. 2. Day 9. Saturday. Lookies, you got to pay up, in it. Maddox shouted up at the house from the street. I'm not paying for being in my own house now, piss off! The man leaning out of the upstairs window of the semi-detached brick-built house shouted down to the gang of youths. You was on the boss man's land now, geez! Maddox shouted in reply, his deep voice resonating in the still warm air. Look, I'm not afraid of a bunch of kids, so piss off! The man shouted down. Red-faced with a balding head and a stocky, muscular build from spending the last 20 years as a builder alongside hard men, and he wasn't easily intimidated, especially by a bunch of hoodie-wearing teenagers. Or what? Maddox shouted back. There's no feds now, bruv! Riker interrupted to a chorus of jeers and catcalls. Feds? What? Fucking kids! The man slammed his window shut and disappeared out of view. Maddox, after giving an irritated glance at Riker, waited a full five seconds before giving the order. Brick it, he shouted, and watched as the crew started throwing missiles at every window in the house. The downstairs had been boarded up from the inside, and the door looked barricaded too. The boss man had said to look for the houses that were boarded up, as it meant they'd have supplies. The strict instruction given to tell the survivors they were being taxed for protection and to give up half their food. Riker and his crew had found this house and soon reported back to Maddox, the boss man's number two, and in charge of the street security taxing operation, as he called it. Maddox had tried reasoning with the man, but he clearly didn't want to oblige with paying his due, so his house got bricked to start with. Shouts and jeers from the teenagers screaming as they threw rocks, house bricks and anything else they could find. Windows of the first floor imploded and shouts of rage brayed out from the man inside. Enough! Maddox raised his hand and listened with satisfaction as the missiles ceased, all apart from one thrown by Riker, another act of defiance to be dealt with later. Oi, geez! Maddox shouted, waiting for the balding man to slowly peer over the windowsill. Your house is fucked up, blood, and we're going to fuck it up some more if you don't give us your stuff. The man peeked over the sill, then dropped back down, staring in fury at the glass fragments strewn about the floor. Little fuckers, he growled. Seething anger boiled up inside him as he stormed down the stairs holding a baseball bat and started undoing the many new locks fitted to the door. He's coming out, bruv, Riker shouted. Yeah, I can see that. Maddox shouted back as the front door burst open and the apoplectic middle-aged man stormed out holding the bat out to one side. Sniggers and laughs sounded out in derision as the teenagers started their mocking. Fuck off! Just fuck off now, you little cunts! The man shouted, holding the bat out, pointing at Maddox and then sweeping along the row of kids all with their hoods up despite the high heat. 
Look at you, old man, Maddox said. You want some, do you? You fucking want some? The man waved the bat around in wide circles and glared back. A gang of scrawny teenagers with skinny legs and skinny arms dressed in baggy tracksuit trousers tucked into their socks, hoods up or baseball caps pulled down. Not one of them could be over 17 years old. Never done a day's work and just sit about smoking weed all day, probably. He wasn't about to be scared out of his home by a bunch of kids. The zombies were bad enough. He'd taken pleasure in killing a few of them, getting supplies back to his house. And then some more that shuffled along when he was boarding up the windows and doors, too. We's keeping the street safe, bruv, Maddox shouted. We're the feds now, so you've got to pay, innit? I ain't giving you shit, boy, the man said with a sneer. Boy? Maddox flared. Listen, old man, you pay up or we will fuck you up. We want your stuff. My stuff? Half your supplies or we're going to fuck you up bad. Come and get it then, boy! The man sneered goadingly. The boss man had warned him about people like this, and Maddox had met a few over the last few days. But the boss man also made it clear that a dead survivor can only pay once, whereas a living survivor would keep paying. The teenagers were itching to start, and Maddox knew he had only to give the word and this old man would be done for. Bunch of fucking nigger kids, packies and cunt Muslims. This ain't your estate, so fuck off. Silence descended as the insults embedded into the young ears. Maddox paused for a beat, then growled. Have him. Within seconds, the front garden was littered with bricks and stones launched by the youths. The man dodged a few and made a few quick steps back to his door before a well-aimed shot to the back of his head brought him down quickly. Bleeding and seeing stars, he stood back up, shaking his head and grasping the bat tightly. The youths moved in, drawing batons taken from the zombie police they had taken down, sticks, chains and knives gripped by the hands of teenagers advancing en masse. The man, realising the missiles had stopped, foolishly stood his ground, bringing his bat up to shoulder height with a two-handed grip and watching to see who would be first to come at him. One good shot to a head would scare these little shits. Crack a skull open and they'll be running off quicker than anything. But they didn't go at him one at a time. These youths, almost feral from years spent running riot and living on council estates, knew their greatest strength was in numbers. Young quick moving and with no remorse they acted like a pack of hyenas and converged at once chains whipping out and striking the man across his back and legs as he swung the bat out wildly hit after hit strike after strike chains whipping and limbs being struck as the youths darted in and out quickly all the time laughing and mocking the old man he fought desperately and felt the sudden danger of his situation with a much bigger build and years of strength behind him, he correctly predicted this would be over in seconds, but not who would win. He staggered back to his door, confusion adding to the shock produced by his muscles after being repeatedly struck by blunt-edged weapons. On shaking legs and with arms barely able to lift the bat, he staggered drunkenly. The first knife came from a boy barely into his teens, a thin blade shoved deep into his side and quickly pulled out as the boy danced back, laughing wildly at the first blood being spilled. The man stumbled from the agonising pain in his side. Another knife plunged in and whipped away. As the man dropped to his knees, screaming in pain, the pack descended, knives lunging, bats striking and chains whipping his skin. Within seconds, he was dead. A bloodied mess of cuts, bruises and livid welts, flowering spots of blood spreading across his light-coloured t-shirt from the knife wounds. Yeah, we fucked you up, blood! One youth danced over the corpse, spitting on the dead man's face. I'm gonna teabag him! Another one shouted and crouched down to rub his groin over the deceased's face. This is where it's at, mofo! He laughs with high-pitched childish delight as his mates bend double at the sight. Get the stuff! Maddox calls out with a firm tone. The youths burst into the man's house, smashing the inside up with screams of joy, bats and sticks creating havoc as they rampage through the rooms, destroying everything in sight. Riker! 
Maddox called to the youth and nodded his head for him to come over. Riker stared back with defiance and then slowly walked over, dropping one leg down to limp in full gangster style. Where you at, bruv? Maddox asked him. I was right here, innit? Riker stared back. Why are you dissing me in front of the crew, Riker? It's all good, Maddox, Riker replied. I didn't mean nothing. We's the feds here, Riker, get it? We make the rules now and they's got to see I'm in charge. Maddox points towards the house, clearly indicating the youths inside. I'm in charge out here, so don't fuck with me, bruv, you get me? Yes, yeah, all good, Riker repeated, dropping his eyes from Maddox and shuffling from foot to foot, showing submission. Maddox held his hand up, which Riker took in a quick, firm grip, leaning in to bump chests before moving off with a swagger back towards the house. Maddox watched as the youth started carrying supplies out, using bin liners and supermarket carrier bags loaded with tinned food, cans, bottles and packets. All right, Maddox. A young girl walked up to him, her hair pulled back in a harsh ponytail, large hooped earrings dangling from her adolescent ears. Alyssa, what's up? Maddox greeted the girl with a nod. Nothing, you? Nothing. That old man was bugging. She smiled with a row of crooked teeth covered in rail track braces. Maddox stared down at the girl wearing an open pink hooded top, her push-up bra trying to force a cleavage where nature had yet to develop. Spotty, pale skin and chewing gum with loud squelches, she stood there shuffling while shaking her head. You got proper fucked, she added. Just like you every night, you dirty sket, Maddox thought to himself. Nodding back, he wondered if the boss man would be pissed off that they had to kill another one for refusing to pay up. Maddox, at 18, and being just that bit older than the other youths, and having already served sentences in young offenders institutes, had been the natural choice for the boss man to use as his number two, and it was a position Maddox intended on keeping. It's well hot, Alyssa said with a whine. Take your top off then, Maddox replied, instantly regretting it as Alyssa took the words as an invitation. Why, you want to see my tits then? She asked with a stupid grin. No, Maddox replied bluntly. Alyssa's face fell at the rebuff. Just because they ain't as big as Skylar's, she whined again. With a brief smile, Maddox walked off, leaving the girl staring after him with a hungry look on her face. Maddox waited for the crew to come out and told them to start heading back knowing the stuff should be taken back before anything else happened. Carrying the spoils, the youth slinked away from the house. Already the conversation had shifted from the life of the human they had just ended to the party to be held tonight, promised by the boss man for all their hard work in cleaning the area of the dirty infected, as he called them. Survival in the urban sprawl at the best of times relies on wits, being quick and able to go through long periods of suffering, skills the youths gathered around Maddox had long perfected. Each one of them born and raised on the huge council estates built along the south coast. Thousands of people from low-income backgrounds forced to live in cheaply built low-rise blocks of flats and terraced houses. The estates were really several housing projects added to and developed over the last 40 years, a sprawling mess of long residential streets, light industrial units servicing the population, twisting alleys, shops with barred windows, supermarkets, pubs and cheap clothing chains. Whole communities struggled to survive and get by. Crime was rife, and the police view, along with many other authorities, was to leave them to suffer. With the council only paying the bare minimum for repair, the estates festered into graffiti-covered walls, houses with boarded doors and windows, front gardens full of broken appliances and furniture. The youths knew no different. Living in social housing with parents and families struggling with their own vices too much to raise their children with any sense of responsibility. Fathers and mothers in prison, brothers and sisters and young offenders, or with foster carers, struggling to make ends meet on benefits and turning to petty crime as a way to boost their income. Drugs use and small-scale supply, taking stolen goods, bent gear, dodgy rip-offs, everything was fair game. Good food was rare, and these youths grew accustomed to getting by on what they could find. Frozen snack food bought cheap from the local supermarket value range, nutritional value low, sugar and salt content high. 
bodies became lean and underdeveloped from the poor diets and regular exercise of running from the homeowners they burgled, the shopkeepers they shoplifted from, and the police that didn't stand a chance of catching them. Young bodies consuming quick fixes that send them wild with energy. Rejection from family life meant they grew into gangs roaming the streets with their own hierarchy and rules. Self-governing, and over time any sense of boundaries broke down as they became wilder and more feral. Alcohol and drug use were common. Underage sex the normal way of life. Stealing and petty crime the standard rules of behaviour. Education systems failed as hard-pressed teachers learnt they could either invest disproportionate time into these youths and stand very little chance of making a difference, or concentrate on the ones that wanted to learn and develop. Abandoned by society and left to run riot on estates that learned either to tolerate them or move out, they grew hardy and tough. So when the event happened and everyone else froze with the shock, unable to think, act quickly or defend themselves, these youths carried on life as normal. Their pack instinct kept them safe. Fleet of foot and cunning meant they could run and hide faster than the mostly obese population. The foraging skills honed over years of stealing meant they found food and sustenance. The normal moral code of society was already separated from them by many degrees, so to them, life carried on as normal. The boss man, having lived amongst this kind for many a year and profiting from the misery all around him, saw a chance of sustaining a way of life. Deep within the largest council estate, the boss man had been growing an empire by taking over disused industrial units. When the former owners were hounded out by the recession and the sharp rise of petty crime, the boss man moved in and planted his fortunes. These units were taken over and adapted into hydroponic factories. Rows and rows of high-yield skunk cannabis plants growing under a systematic setup of very high-output lamps. The VHO lights set on timer to achieve the highest potency by giving the plants the strongest light source for the greatest length of time. The heat meant the plants emitted a strong, distinct odour which was sucked away by fans, forcing the warm, pungent air through long ducts and filters, breaking the scent down before pumping it out harmlessly into the undergrowth outside. As each unit was taken over, they were knocked through with makeshift doors holed into the adjoining walls. Each section was used for a specific purpose. The nursery, where the baby plants were covered by plastic covers and protected during their infancy. The second growth stage, where the plants stood a few inches high. The third growth stage of sturdy but immature plants. Through to the final growth of giant bushy plants, ripe with sticky buds, and each one standing six feet in height. A forest of marijuana, a wooded copse of cannabis leaf, high heat and humidity, and the plants were cared for with the same attention as the average tropical garden centre. The drying area, where the plants were cropped and left in a strictly controlled dry environment, the weighing and bagging section where the plants were cut down and bagged into their sale bags, bought in bulk from the internet and delivered to an address on the estate, the boss man was shrewd and maintained a kindly uncle-type figure to the youths. Everyone on this and the surrounding estates owed him in one way or another. Either on tick for weed they had taken but not paid for, or on money loaned out by him. When repayment became too hard, they simply started work for the boss man, dealing in a set area or holding large amounts of pre-wrapped cannabis ready to be collected and dealt. This way, they took the risk and no one, ever snitched on the boss man. Fear of the repercussion, of being alienated and seriously hurt and more because of the constant supply of drugs they relied on. Nearly every youth ended up running directly for the boss man. He knew they would easily outrun the police and the penalties would be far less for a juvenile than for an adult. In return, they were well rewarded. Sell more, get more. Sell a lot and get a lot. Sales prospered, and despite the recession and lack of career options, the youths flourished under the boss man's watchful gaze. Always ready to listen to their problems and enforcing discipline through the bigger lads, he rarely had to use force himself, but his reputation was well known enough to ensure he was never crossed. As the world fell, the boss man moved quickly. Gathering his youths and moving them into the industrial units, he quickly set about fortifying the land. Stealing flatbed lorries and raiding garden centres and builders' merchants, he erected high fencing covered with coils of razor wire. 
The boss man already had a small arsenal of weapons, mainly shotguns and rifles, but a few pistols too, and his arsenal was quickly enhanced as he led a well-armed raid on the local gunsmiths, looting the place empty. By late afternoon on the second day of the event, the boss man had used the newly gained weapons and the flatbed lorries to raid the local shops and supermarket, stripping the shelves and stockrooms bare, stockpiling everything from tin goods to clothing in the many cupboards and storerooms of the compound. Now nine days into the event, and the compound was the safest and best stocked place for miles. Knowing the power supply would end soon, he set about securing solar panels and wiring, setting the panels on the roofs of the units and running the cables down to feed the lights that fed the plants. The plants that he still used as payment for the youths sent out to rid the immediate area of the dirty infected. House by house, street by street, section by section, the youths swept through, killing everything that got in their way. At night, they hunkered down and prepared to defend their territory, but by day, they advanced and slowly gained the streets. As reports of survivors drifted back to the boss man, he realised there was an avenue of earning to be tapped into. His crews were taking the risk in dealing with the dirty infected, and that meant everyone was safer. If they wanted to live in his area, they had to pay. So the boss man introduced the street security taxing operation and got Maddox to brief the crews to only take half initially, and only to take it all if it was obvious the survivor would refuse to pay or if they tried to attack the crews. Not wanting to take the constant risk of being out on the street himself, the boss man promoted Maddox as his number two in overall charge. Then, in turn, Maddox established crews working in set areas. Each crew had a crew chief, and that crew chief could run their crew as he or she saw fit. Eight crews each, with between ten to a dozen youths, and the compound was full. But the method worked better than he ever expected, with each crew becoming a tight unit. Food and water was plentiful, and these youths had already survived years of going without, so they didn't need much. And by allowing them to get stoned every night meant they were mostly peaceful, apart from the few cases of acute paranoia that caused fights. Quickly dealt with by the crew chiefs, and a punishment decided by Maddox. The crews worked well alongside each other and were quick to back each other up, moving between areas and sections as the need arose. Some of the adults that survived the carnage sweeping through the close-knit streets tried to barter their way into the compound. Some younger and prettier women were taken in on the basis they would tend to the plants, feed the youths and keep the compound clean. The others were sent away. If they refused, they were removed. If they resisted, they were killed. It was brutal, but it worked. Maddox led his and Riker's crew back through the estate towards the compound, listening with interest as the boys and girls talked about the music they were going to listen to during the party tonight. Maddox had spoken with the boss man in his office, suggesting they hold a weekend party to give the youths a chance to blow off some steam. The boss man readily agreed, telling Maddox he could sort it out as he saw fit, but telling him to keep a few of the bigger lads sober and clear-headed to act as bouncers in case of problems. It was also Maddox that decided who was to provide security within the compound each day. At first, he selected the bigger lads himself, but then he put the job down to the crew chiefs to nominate three from each crew to stay back each day. Those youths were armed with shotguns and given easy sentry jobs on the walls, fences and main gate. A few more were sent out to stand sentry on the junctions of the road leading into the compound. Shortwave radios sourced from a local electrical outlet were used as a way of keeping constant contact. The sentry jobs inside the compound were seen as a cushy number and gave the youths a chance to look cool and hard with guns. The sentry rolls out on the junctions were hated as the youths were left isolated and under strict orders not to piss about or go anywhere. Despite the strange setup, some rules were enforced with instant punishment if breached. Racism was outlawed and faced severe consequences if used by any youth, no matter what the circumstance. The strong ethnic mix of the youths meant that there was no predominant race in higher numbers. Religion was as outlawed as racism, and despite many of the youths coming from various religious backgrounds, they were told they could worship in their heads, but not to anyone else. Sexist attitudes were gone, with nearly as many girls being crew chiefs as boys. 
One of the crews, headed by Sierra, consisted solely of girls and had one of the highest kill rates of the dirty infected. Maddox had worked with all the crews and made sure he got on with all of them. Everyone had respect for Maddox. He was fair and easygoing, ready to teach the younger kids but renowned for his hard streak and had a reputation for never having been beaten in a street fight. Well developed for his age, the Afro-Caribbean lad was stacked with muscle on his lean frame, hours spent in the prison gym, enhanced by high protein, and surprisingly, he never smoked weed or took pills. He was happy to deal it, and made good money working for the boss man, introducing good contacts and steadily working his way up the chain of command even before the event happened. Upstarts like Riker were dealt with quickly, and Maddox, like any good manager, was quick to spot dissenters and troublemakers taking them aside and addressing the offending behaviour, preventing the issues from developing. Riker would be watched from now on. As a crew chief, he was given extra weed and more food, but the last day or so he'd been coming back with more tax than was right, telling Maddox that the residents were refusing to pay up, so they had to be dealt with and killed. Maddox suspected that Riker was killing them out of fun, which went against what they were trying to achieve. Knowing that a family of survivors would keep paying up with whatever they sourced and foraged themselves would be a better future prospect than just taking everything they had now. A few kills here and there helped spread the word and made the others take notice, but too many would see the residents left on the estates trying to flee and run away. Today, though, Maddox could see they didn't have any choice. He had tagged along with Riker's crew himself to see how they operated. The big, bald man had to be dealt with, though. He was the type that would always cause problems for the crew, so it was better he was sorted now. Maddox was irritated that Riker wasn't given a chance to show his bartering skills, though, as he wanted to see how Riker would deal with a family of survivors willing to pay. Nearing the compound, Maddox, out front and watching intently, looked round for the sentry that should be on this junction. The chair and table dragged out onto the street for the sentry to use was empty. Frowning, Maddox held the others up and started walking over to the empty chair as a youth ran out of the nearest building doing the zipper up on his baggy jeans, shotgun wedged under his arm. Ah, fuck, Maddox, the youth said in a panicking voice. I needed a piss. The fear was heightened by Maddox remaining silent as he strode quickly at the lad and stopped inches from his nose. The lad cowered back, clearly terrified and grimacing from the expected punch. Maddox held his hard gaze for long seconds before turning to face the gathered crew, watching with unsuppressed glee at the prospect of a beating. Go on, Maddox told them bluntly. They did as ordered and moved off down the street towards the compound, laughing and looking back at Maddox towering over the child. Zayden, yeah? Maddox asked, not needing the confirmation. He knew every youth in the compound knew who their families were, knew what background they had and who they were mates with. Knowledge was power. Power got you off the street. You're with Darius's crew. A statement, not a question, but the terrified youth nodded back anyway. You need a piss, Satan. You piss here. If you've got to take a dump, you shit here. You get me. Yeah, Maddox, Zayden whimpered, full of remorse and fear. Don't be leaving your post again. What if the dirty infected got past here? What then, Zayden? You get fucked over as what? I know, Zayden nodded quickly, fumbling to bring his shotgun from under his arm but not having the room to swing it out with Maddox standing so close and not daring to brush the gun against Maddox either. So he held it clumsily between his arm and his free hand stretched over. Darius will sort you out. Maddox sighed and saw the relief rise in Zayden's eyes as he realised a beating wouldn't be happening. Maddox used violence as a tool, and despite what many thought, he did not get the sadistic pleasure most of them got from unabated violence. He grew up hard and with a good skill at fighting, learning to think coldly and not allowing his temper to draw him into making mistakes, knowing that with every fight there was a winner and always a loser. Stay on your post, Maddox added before walking off and leaving the youth breathing a long sigh. Also, Maddox turned to smile at Zayden. We got the party tonight, innit, and I see that Lauren giving you the eye. Maddox laughed, his features changing dramatically as he flashed his bright white teeth. Don't be fucking up and missing the chance to get it on with her, eh, bruv? No, I swear down, Maddox. 
Zayden beamed back, almost floating off the floor with the thought that Maddox had seen him and Lauren smiling at each other for the past couple of days. And make sure you bag it up, Maddox pulled the cardboard box of condoms from his pocket, launching them at Zayden as he walked off, grinning. Maddox took a few steps, left it a few more seconds, and quickly glanced round. Zayden was stood firm and upright on the junction, with the shotgun clasped between his skinny arms. Giving Zayden a beating would have kept him alert through fear, but ruling through fear alone brought issues. Issues him and the boss man didn't need. Instead, he took the lad's fear and made it positive instead. Letting him know that Lauren fancied him was a finishing touch that put the kid on cloud nine, and Maddox knew he'd stand there alert and watchful for the rest of the day. Striding with confidence, Maddox thought ahead to the many tasks that needed sorting. Prioritising them in his mind as he approached the high solid metal gates topped with coils of razor wire. Already opened up for Riker and his crew to enter, the youth allocated the gate guard role for the day, waited as Maddox walked in. We're at Maddox, the youth nodded, his sweating face peering out from underneath his hood. You sweating, bruv? Maddox stared at the lad and glanced round to see if the boy had thought to drink during the hot day. Where's your bottle, Liam? Bottle? Liam asked in a surly tone, then instantly regretted it on getting a glare from Maddox. I told you to make sure you had water. Where's your bottle? I don't like water, Maddox, Liam answered. What did I say happens when you don't drink? You said I get dehydrated. Dehydrated, Maddox corrected him. You get dehydrated, your piss stinks, and your cock will shrivel up. Do you want your cock to shrivel up? That's fucking gross, Liam spat. Then drink some water, in it. Maddox helped him pull the gate closed and told him to go fetch two bottles from the storeroom while he took watch. Liam handed him the shotgun before running off through the compound. Staring round him, Maddox took in the view. The long, low-rise unit stretched off into the distance, open ground all around a mixture of concrete and grass. The boss man had secured a good area. The high fencing stretched round one side with natural high walls bordering the other. On this side, there was the barest signs of living. A few chairs, sofas and odd furniture scattered about for use of the sentry guards. A wooden shed literally picked up and carried in from a nearby garden served as a sentry hut as the youths rotated on the patrol patterns set by Maddox. Staring at the land, Maddox thought ahead to how he would get the concrete ripped up and seeds planted for food, sustaining their stocks and ensuring survival after the easy months of summer have passed. To his eye, there was a future here. The nearby houses could be converted and taken over. The boundary fence extended and more accommodation gained. Watching Liam come jogging back with two full bottles of water, Maddox thought of how they'd need a clean water supply once the bottles were gone and if the taps ran dry. The plants consumed huge amounts of water every day, and that would need to be sustained too. Liam handed him the bottle and stood there, unsure of himself as Maddox stared back expectantly. Drink. Maddox said the word simply and watched as Liam sulkily screwed the top off and started glugging the clear liquid down. Within the first few gulps, Liam realised how thirsty he was and how refreshing the water felt in his parched mouth. Greedily slurping it down, some of the water splashing from the bottle, from his chin and down the front of his hoodie. Leaning his head back to upend the bottle, Liam drank the contents down in one go, giving a gasp and then a big belch as he pulled the now empty bottle away. All right? Maddox asked with humour. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Liam answered with a grin that made him look like the young boy he really was. You don't have to wear that all day, Maddox said, pointing at the dark top worn by Liam. The boy looked pale and sickly. Too much weed... Too many late nights and not enough decent food, and this was another problem faced by Maddox. The kids had a certain amount of freedom within the compound, as long as they followed the rules. Outside, they had their sections to cover, but smoking cannabis all evening, eating crap munchies, and drinking alcohol would waste them away. Maddox knew they had to sustain their energy in order to survive, and he needed them to survive, so they all survived.
I'll be back in an hour. Maddox handed him the second bottle of water. Make sure that one is drunk too, you get me? Yeah, sweet. Liam nodded already feeling better for the liquid purging through his system. Walking off, Maddox headed across the concrete. Squinting his eyes against the glare of the sun, he crossed the end of the first unit. Glancing in through the wide metal double doors slid back to reveal the occupants inside. The first unit had been hastily converted into a day room with sofas, easy chairs, tables and rugs laid out. The young women taken in to run the compound worked from the day room, running further into the unit to tend the plants and controlling the stores held behind locked doors. On seeing Maddox cross the doors, the few women inside the unit, sheltering from the heat of the plantations and the heat from outside, waved and smiled. Nodding back, Maddox walked across the doors and stopped at the corner, facing the wide grounds at the back of the buildings. Big canvas tents taken from the looted shops covered most of the ground. At first, they had been stuck up in any old fashion, with no thought given to layout. As the crews were decided, Maddox redesigned the layout so each crew chief had their own tent, with the rest of the crew split into smaller ones. Each crew had a large day tent where they could meet, chill out or do what they wanted when not on duty. Strangely, after years of rejecting anything to do with home or family, the youths took to the system with eagerness. The crews worked themselves out, making minor adjustments here and there, keeping the walkway lanes clear and making sure there was a clear and distinct gap between each section. There was still plenty of open land here, Maddox thought, as his eyes swept across the grounds. A huge open bonfire was lit every night, known as the pit, and it gave the youth somewhere to gather round and crash out smoking joints. Walking alongside the long wall of the units, Maddox made his way across the camp towards the pit, his mind still making mental checklists. Halfway along, he entered the units through a single door propped open, the pungent smell of cannabis filling his nostrils instantly and the humidity from the watered plants prickling his already hot skin. Walking through the units, he briefly checked each growth stage, looking for any plants wilting or hanging low from lack of water. The women working their way from plant to plant with hoses nodded, smiled and waved as he walked through. After several minutes of walking, he reached the last unit. This one set aside solely for the boss man's use. Knocking on the door, he waited for the invitation to enter. Enter. A deep voice boomed out. Maddox grinned to himself and pushed the door open to see the boss man sat behind a desk, staring at sheets of paper laid out in front of him. Boss? Maddox nodded, respectfully. Maddox, how you doing, son? Everything all right, is it? The boss man looked up, his voice friendly and genuine warmth at the sight of his deputy. All good, Maddox replied. He walked over and sat down in a big, comfy chair opposite the desk, noticing the heavy smoke of a recent joint hanging in the air. So how was Riker? The boss man asked with an interested but obviously stoned gaze. A medium-built man with close-cropped hair just starting to grey at the temples. Dressed in a suit, he could be a high-class lawyer. Dressed in overalls, he could be a reliable mechanic. The boss man suited anything he wore, and with his easy smile and laughing eyes, he got on with just about everyone he met. People liked him. People wanted to like him. But more importantly, people wanted him to like them. Good, Maddox nodded. We found one man in his house, but he refused to pay, so we had to resolve the situation, Maddox explained. The street language dropped now as he spoke in calm, measured tones. Who did the talking? The boss man asked. Riker started, but I took over at the end. He clearly wasn't going to pay, so we had to sort it. He came out with a bat and started taking swings at the crew. Who was it? A bald man in a semi-detached house on Sycamore Avenue, Maddox replied. What, old Naylor? The boss man looked surprised for a second. He always was a bloody idiot. Good builder, though, I'll give him that. Christ, so he survived it, did he? He did, Maddox answered, but not now. Oh well, serves him right. He had to do what he had to do. The boss man nodded deeply with a knowing look. So everything else all right, is it? 
Zayden left his post out on the junction to go for a piss. Sorted him out, though. Well, that little lad out there on his own. He's on Darius's crew. Darius said he's a good lad. How did you sort it? I gave him a hard stare till he shit himself, then gave him a bollocking. Told him I knew Lauren fancied him, so he didn't want to miss the party by being in the shit. Good lad. The boss man laughed appreciatively. Good work. Never use a slap unless you have no other choice. Win them over and they'll work their bollocks off for you. I know, Maddox nodded, listening intently. He always listened when the boss man explained things. It was the boss man that got him out of talking street, as he called it, when they were together, telling Maddox that a king had to be able to talk with all his men. It was also the boss man that taught Maddox getting people to love you gave them more loyalty than fear will ever give. But fear, used at the right time and the right place, will do the work of a thousand requests. Liam was on the gate sweating in his hoodie. He hadn't drank any water for hours, Maddox continued. Shaking his head and tutting, the boss man looked worried as he rolled another joint. We need to sort that out, Maddox. This heat will have them dropping like flies if we ain't careful. Are they washing? If they don't drink and don't wash, they'll get sick. Ever heard of dysentery? Maddox shook his head. It's what the soldiers used to get when they went days without clean water, shit food and not cleaning themselves. If we get that here, we'd all be down with it. Gives you the chronic shits and makes you weak. Okay, boss, Maddox nodded. So we need to get them washed and drinking clean water. I was getting worried about the shit they're eating too and smoking weed all night. Here's what you do. The boss man leant in, speaking quickly and using his hands with quick movements. Get the crew chiefs to be responsible for making sure they're washed, but make sure the girls do the girls, and I don't want any perving going on, mind. Get some exercise equipment outside and get the kids seeing you and some of the other fit lads training. They'll want to join in and be like you, but then you tell them unless they start eating decent, they can't train. Give them an incentive. As for the weed, well, it keeps them settled. That Darius is a fit lad. Get him and that Ryland in on it. We've got stacks of those multivitamins here, boss. Can we start giving them out in the mornings? Bloody good idea, Maddox. The boss man smiled encouragingly. Yeah, do that. Anything else? The party. I got some televisions taken from the houses near here, and I got the Xboxes all rigged up. You still all right if we switch the power over for a few hours? We got a DJ booth rigged up too. Maddox. You do what needs doing, son. I told you, you're in charge on the ground, so you make the decision. I'm here for the bigger things, to oversee it all and make sure we got enough of everything. The boss man replied, lighting the joint. Yeah, sweet boss. Maddox, what have I told you about your language? Sorry, boss, I meant thank you. That's better. You speak to them how they understand it, but you've got to know how to speak with everyone. I understand. Do you? Well, I'm not sure I fully understand the last statement of confirmation you made, and I would ask that you kindly elaborate for me. The boss man switched to a cultured tone, sounding intelligent and refined. He looked expectantly at Maddox, just as Maddox looked expectantly at Liam just a few minutes ago. Do I have to? Maddox groaned with a sheepish smile. I would rather that indeed you do have to. Sighing, Maddox sat up straight and rolled his eyes as the boss man smiled in good humour. Well, in response to your previous comment concerning my assent of confirmation, I would hereby state for the record that my confirmation of understanding was given in a truthful manner and one which I can barely see any reason for doubting. Therewithal, I challenge any doubt on my words and seek clarity should there be any further confusion on the subject. Maddox, that was brilliant. The boss man beamed and leant over to shake his hand, pumping it greatly. It's getting better all the time. Thanks, boss, Maddox answered. Look, I know the world is fucked beyond repair, and those fucking things are stomping about eating everyone. But you never know when you might need to speak properly. A king needs to talk with all his men. There is a world beyond this estate, Maddox. Other survivors that will come here and want to trade... We heard that explosion a few days ago, so we know there is shit going down in other places. Now, anything else? Maddox nods in response. 
They had all heard the explosion of the housing estate detonated by Dave and Jamie, and they all felt the tremor in the ground as window panes rattled in their frames, followed by a huge mushroom cloud boiling up high into the sky. It was early morning, barely dawn, and it brought every youth out into the open grounds of the compound and staring off into the distance, and it served to remind them all of the things that must be going on in other places. The planting of crops I mentioned. Maddox, it's only been a few days. Slow down, son. The boss man sat back in his chair and puffed on the joint. Let's get tonight out of the way, give the lads some chill-out time. We'll get together over the next couple of days and work out exactly where you want to do it, OK? Yeah, OK, boss. Maddox relented with an easy smile. Good. Now, piss off. I've got plant feed and yields to calculate. OK. Maddox got to his feet and crossed the rug-covered floor. How's it going with Skylar? The boss man asked quickly. Skylar? Yeah, she's all right. Maddox replied, aloof as always, when the boss man asked him about women. Just all right, is she? She looks more than all right to me, son, he said, lighting the joint and inhaling deeply. We'll see. Maddox grinned before letting himself out and slowly closing the door. The grin faded as the door shut with a click. Maddox liked the boss man and was genuinely pleased that he had given him the top job, but he also knew he had earned it. Sorting through a thousand tasks every day that came through him instead of the boss. As the days went on, his reputation grew as did his sense of responsibility. Even the women in the unit saw him as the go-to man. The boss man was friendly enough, but after the initial mad rush of the first few days, getting the compound secure, stocking food and getting weapons, he spent more and more time in his office, worrying and fretting about plant food, what yields he would get from the plants, smoking joints and leaving everything to Maddox. The boss man had always smoked weed, but never this much, and it worried Maddox. As he left, Maddox thought back to that first night, He'd been with the boss man driving through the estate in the big Mercedes as Maddox counted out the night's takings. You done well tonight then, Maddox? Yeah, very well, Maddox replied quietly as he leafed through the thick bundle of £20 notes. Any trouble? Nah, a couple of those jumped-up college kids again trying to give it large. Be careful with them, the boss man warned. Don't deal to them yourself. Get one of the kids to do it. If they get nicked, they'll bubble you up quicker than anything. I did, Maddox replied. Good lad. What the fuck is that? The boss man leant forward, looking through the windscreen at the figure stood in the middle of the road. He must be pissed, Maddox chuckled. What, round here? The boss man replied, looking round at the quiet residential street. Is he bleeding? Look, he's hurt. Maddox peered at the man covered in blood and staggering around on unsteady feet. Who is it? The boss man asked. Is he one of ours? I fucking hope not, Maddox answered, knowing that anyone touching one of their kids would be dealt with very harshly. Ah, that's a man, that is, not a kid. The boss man brought the car to a gradual stop a few metres from the figure. I'll go and see, Maddox replied. I'll come with you, the boss man said. They climbed out of the vehicle and moved towards the figure, both of them staring hard and trying to see who the man was. Thick, wet blood coated his face, and a large open wound was flapping on his neck. All right, mate, the boss man called out. What happened? The figure turned and stared towards the boss man, a low growl coming from his throat. Boss, Maddox shouted the warning as the figure burst to life and ran at the boss man. Maddox met the man just feet before he reached the boss man and powered him to the ground. The injured man writhed and bucked, howling loudly as it tried to lunge and bite out. Fuck, who's trying to bite me? Maddox yelled and slammed his fist into the side of the man's head. The blow had little effect as the man kept thrashing his head and gnashing at Maddox. Hold up, son. The boss man ran in and kicked the downed man in the ribs. Still no effect, and the thing raged and fought furiously. Fuck me, you must be on crack, the boss man shouted. Have him, Maddox. Maddox responded with a flurry of hard, powerful blows aimed down at the side of the man's head, 
purposefully avoiding the already bloodied face and not wanting to get blood on his hands. He ain't stopping, Maddox shouted in alarm. Shit. The boss man leapt back as another howling figure lunged at him. The fight stepped up a notch as both men realised the danger of their situation. Two crazy men trying to attack them on their own turf. This must be serious. Maddox jumped up and slammed his foot down onto the man's face and heard the snapping of bone. Without further delay, he turned round to see the boss man flick the blade out on his switchblade and stick the sharpened point repeatedly into the chest of the attacking figure. Maddox ran over and grabbed the man from behind, pulling him away as the boss man plunged the knife into the throat. Dropping the body to the floor, they both stood in shock, staring at the bodies, then at each other. What the fuck was all that about? the boss man asked quietly. We gotta go, boss. The feds will be all over this. Yeah, right. Fuck, is that another one? They both turned to see another figure running at them. A middle-aged woman dressed in a paisley dressing gown and pink fluffy bunny slippers. A ragged wound on her face and blood coating the front of her nightclothes. You are fucking joking. The boss man shook his head. Boss, give me that... Maddox took the knife from the older man and walked at the figure charging towards them, sidestepping at the last second as the woman lunged forward with her lips pulled back. Maddox punched her hard to the side of her head and she went down, thudding her head into the side of the Mercedes. Watch the bleeding car, the boss man shouted. Sorry boss, Maddox replied. The woman showed no reaction and clambered quickly to her feet, turning to lunge at Maddox. He danced backwards, trying to fend the woman off with his free hand. Feeling the side of a car behind him and knowing the woman was going to bite him, he lashed out and swept the blade across her throat. A crimson spray of blood spurting out and soaking Maddox's clothes. You'll have to burn them now, the boss man tutted. You'll be covered in her DNA. Boss, what's going on? Maddox shouted. They're trying to bite us. Fuck me, more? The boss man shouted as more figures appeared further down the street running towards them in that same jerky manner. The powerful headlights of the Mercedes illuminated the throng of nightclothes wearing attackers as they poured up the road. The boss man watched them intently, taking in the injuries, the blood-soaked clothes, the jerky motion of their running and finally the red bloodshot eyes. Maddox, get in the car, son, quick! They both climbed in and slammed the doors closed. Without hesitation, the boss man put the vehicle into gear and pressed his foot down hard. The car shot forward, accelerating quickly and heading straight towards the oncoming group. They ain't moving, Maddox shouted as the first ones impacted on the bonnet and went flying over the top of the vehicle. More thuds as the vehicle ploughed them down and sped off. Each street they went through, more bodies were out in the road. Groups of people were fighting each other, more on the ground being bitten and savaged. Screams and shouts pierced the air as they drove quickly through the estate. Get to the units, Maddox shouted through the window at a group of youths running down the street. They swept through, shouting the same thing to any youth they recognised as one of theirs, telling them to pass the message on. By the time they got back, there were already crowds of youths standing about and looking either pumped up or terrified. That's when the boss man showed why he was in charge. Within minutes, he had the units open and the youth safely inside and watchers out guiding more kids in. He was a good leader, and despite the now constant weed smoking, Maddox felt a deep sense of loyalty to him. Re-entering the drying area, he quickly inspected the drying crops, counting the bundles and checking the correct amounts were there. No one would dare steal from the boss man or Maddox, but it didn't hurt to check everything once in a while. Lensky, Maddox called out to the high cheekboned woman walking past the door with a clipboard in hand. Lensky had been one of the young adult women accepted into the compound as society outside the gates crumbled. Quickly proving herself to be intelligent and capable, she effectively ran the inside of the units when Maddox wasn't present, holding the keys to the food and alcohol stores. Maddox, you are back then, the Polish woman replied, her English good but still retaining a strong Eastern European edge. Yeah, everything okay here? Maddox forgot to reintroduce his street talk, sticking to his preferred normal voice while talking to the beautiful but very hard-faced woman. It's good, Maddox, all is good here, yes? 
she nodded back, giving a brief smile. The sentries aren't drinking enough in the heat, and they don't have the brains to come and get something. Can you make sure someone takes water out to them every couple of hours and make sure they've got food too? Sure, I do this. Lenski nodded again, making a quick note on her own ever-growing list of things to do. Also, can you get the packs of multivitamins out and make sure there's a bottle in every tent? Multivitamins, Lenski added it to her list. And we need to make sure they're washing properly. Are they using the baby wipes you gave them? I do not think they use these, Lenski replied in her husky voice. The packets, they are still full, no? I'll speak to the crew chiefs and get them on it, but we might need your help with the girls. Yeah, I'll get you and Sierra to talk to the girls, and Darius and me can talk to the lads. Sierra and Darius were both crew chiefs, and also an established couple. At 17 years old, they were also older than most of the youths, and looked up to as figures of authority. Sure, I do this too. I do more every day, Lenski replied with a pursed mouth. I can send someone else in to help you. I'll sort it out tonight. That is a good thing. The plants, they need the water. The food, it needs to be done. The washing clothes is many. In here we only have a few, but you have many. I got it, Linsky. Maddox could see she was being genuine. Initially, the older girls had been quiet and sullen, and after a couple of days, he could tell they were thinking they were being held captive and forced into slave labour. Maddox could see the problems this would cause, and took them all out into the streets showed them what there was out there, and said they could come or go as they pleased. Admittedly, he did take them to the roughest area where the most kills had been made, and they quickly chose to remain in the safety of the compound. Since then, Maddox had made it clear they could leave any time they wished. None of them did. Lenski had taken the role seriously and guarded the food with a hawk eye, making sure her girls washed the clothes, cleaned the base and tended the plants. Maddox greatly admired the beautiful woman, and despite the comments being made now, he knew she cared for the youths. It's okay with me now, she added with a smile, then looked at him thoughtfully. You okay, Maddox? You look tired. Many late nights, no? Come and sit, I make you drink. He followed the woman as she turned and walked through the plantation. Have the crews brought much in today? he asked, instead of eyeing up her shapely backside. We get some, yes, many more tins of food now, more today than yesterday. Did you ask about the garden for the crops? He said we'll talk about it after the party. But this is July, we late for planting already. Plant now quickly or we do the idea I said. Lenski, the boss man isn't going to give up a unit for growing food. But we eat or we die. The food they bring it good, but it not last many weeks. The young people, they eat many times. We have the lights, the water, the heat. Okay, I know. Let's get tonight done, then I can ask him tomorrow. Poor Maddox, so busy. She turned with a smile. Not being able to tell if she was genuine or being sarcastic, Maddox stayed quiet. You're just 18, no? A child. But you are a man, Maddox. You are a great man the way you do this, she added. Someone has to. Maddox replied quietly, uncomfortable with the compliment. You lead here. You tell everyone what they do. All the day I hear Maddox say this, Maddox say that, Maddox the Great. She laughed, a pleasing sound full of delight which made him smile. (laughs) All I hear is Lenski said no, Lenski said get out, Lenski said piss off, Maddox replied quickly. She laughed harder, whacking him on the arm with her clipboard. I rule with fear, you with love, she smiled again. The afternoon stretched on, another day passing slowly with crews returning to the compound, bags filled with taxed goods taken from the survivors found living on the sprawling estates. Reports of clusters of the dirty infected roaming certain streets, crews dispatched to find and eliminate them. Listening to the reports given by the chiefs, giving instructions, arranging the party for the evening, and everything done with the compound going through Maddox, No signs of flustering or irritation at the constant interruptions. The muscular teenager evolved into his role as natural leader, and with each passing hour of each passing day, his aura grows. He learns quickly, developing his own easy style, giving orders that aren't questioned, advice that isn't rebuked. 
Lenski finds she is equally busy as Maddox learns that he can't take everything on himself and fielding more and more of the questions and requests for help to the Polish woman. A natural hierarchy developed from necessity, capable people doing the things needed to be done. As with Maddox, Lenski develops her own style, not as friendly or approachable as Maddox, but she listens to each youth in turn and jots down on her ever-growing list or sends them packing with a few words of caustic advice. It seems that every few minutes something else happens. Someone else has a question. Never more than a few steps taken in any given direction before one of the youths calls out in street language. Some of them confident and coming straight to the point, others shy and shuffling nervously as they're prompted and probed to find the problem. Late afternoon, Maddox found himself alone in his quarters, two small adjoining offices separated by stud walls, one of them his room, the other initially empty, but then given over to Lenski as Maddox watched her develop. Knowing that by giving her a private room, she would be seen as a higher up, and also serving to give her some privacy which she would value, and then make sure she worked hard enough to keep. Other than the boss man, theirs were the only fully private rooms. The crew chiefs had their own tents, but nothing beat having solid walls round you, and a fully functioning door that could be closed. As it was, because of the sheer volume of work needed to be done within the compound, neither of them used the rooms apart from a few hours of exhausted sleep. Standing there enjoying the quiet for a few minutes, away from the hustle of the compound now full after nearly all the crews had returned, he allowed his mind to settle, and again started going through mental checklists of what was still to be done. Sighing, he turned at the door being knocked and pushed open. People at the gate, Lenski said, simply. What people? I not know this, she shrugged. Come on, Maddox walked past. I come with you? She asked to clarify, but already walking next to him. Yeah, he nodded, staring ahead at the armed youths running towards the front of the compound. The gathered youths parted as Maddox waded through them, reaching the front and staring through the central section, giving a view of the street ahead. Several adults were gathered on the junction where Zayden should be, looking back down at the compound. Where's Zayden at? Maddox asked. Here, Darius pushed the youth forward. Zayden, who are they? Maddox questioned the lad. I don't know, swear down, they said they wanted to talk to the boss man. They armed? I didn't see nothing, no guns. Do you know them? Maddox asked, peering through the gap and thinking they need a scaffold tower built high so they can see over the top of the gate. No, nah, Maddox, Zayden answered. Darius, you and me, bruv, get a shotgun. I got your back, Maddox, Darius said quickly. Sierra, Maddox looked over to the girl. You too. Open up. Maddox gave the order as one gate was swung open with enough room for them to step through. Stay by me, he told the crew chiefs. They dropped back a few steps, staying quiet and keeping their faces blank as Maddox and Lenski walked ahead. Striding down the straight road, Maddox took in the details of the adults. Three men and two women all looking filthy and gaunt. Maddox recognised three of the faces from the estate and clocked that they're not customers of the boss man, just some of the many background people that made up life here. Watching the approaching foursome, the group started moving towards them. Holding his hand up to warn them to stay back, Maddox asserted control of the encounter by being the one to walk to them, already sending a clear signal. You the boss man? One of the men asked as Maddox came to a stop several metres away. No, nah, bruv, Maddox answered. He's busy, innit? We want to talk to him, the man said. I said he's busy, innit? What do you want? Maddox kept his tone blunt, but his face passive. Your boys are taking too much, we got nothing left, one of the women said, her face and hair looking filthy and bedraggled. Have you seen the infected? Maddox asked. No, you don't see them. We sorted them, so you've got to pay up, innit? I got kids, the woman blurted out. They ain't getting enough to eat with your tax taking everything. You's all from the Oak Estate, innit? How old are your kids? We want to talk to the boss man, not some bloody kid, the first man to speak said angrily. Who are you? Maddox glared at the man. The boss man busy, so you got me. How old are your kids? Twelve and thirteen, the woman replied, wiping a strand of greasy hair from her face. 
They can come here, live with us, we've got plenty of food for them. Yeah, because you've got all our bloody food, the first man strode forward, his face red and flustered. Maddox sensed Darius and Sierra shifting behind him and waved his hand at his side, signalling them to stand down. You got all the kids here and all the food. We need to eat too. We want our food back. Nah, bruv, you get me. Get what? We want our fucking food back. Go find some, Maddox replied, watching the man intently, his face still passive. We found our food, you find yours. You pay up, we keep it safe, innit? No, in it, the man shouted, his anger exploding at the impudence of the hard-faced youth staring back. You're just fucking kids playing at grown-ups. If we had those guns, we'd be in charge. But you ain't bruv. You stayed at home shitting your pants while we got this rigged up. We took the risks and got the prize. Go home. You're fucking lucky you got them shotguns behind you, the man raged from a few feet away, pointing and thrusting his finger at Maddox. Or what, Maddox answered. Or I'd kick your fucking head in, the man bellowed. Go home. Maddox dismissed the man with a sneer. Tell your kids they can come and live with us. We got weed you can have, but no food. Weed? The woman asked with sudden interest. You ain't that hungry then, are you? Maddox mused to himself. We don't want any fucking drugs, we want food. The man stepped forward again. Maddox stared ahead, avoiding looking at the man but sensing his proximity. Back up, bruv, Maddox warned him. Why, are you going to shoot me? He sneered, dangerously overstepping the mark. Why can't we live here too? The second woman asked, her voice strained and weak. No, Maddox replied. Go home. You come here again and we'll fuck you up. Swear down. Right, I want to speak with the boss man right now! The man exploded in fury. Jeff, one of the women said with a warning tone. No, I'm not going to be told what to do by a bunch of fucking retard chavvy gangster kids. Maddox reacted quickly, crossing the distance and punching the man once in the face, dropping him instantly. No anger, but using violence and fear to enforce the message he'd already given them several times. He also knew that they were being watched by every youth in the compound. Go home. Maddox stared at each of them in turn, his voice still low and calm. We're going, one of the other men darted forward to start dragging the unconscious form away. What about the weed? the woman asked. We'll drop some round tomorrow, Maddox replied. Turning, he indicated to the others and started walking back towards the compound. Going ahead with Lenski, while Sierra and Darius dropped back and cover the rear. Why we not give them food? Lenski asked quietly. Maddox paused before answering, quickly trying to figure if her question was challenging his authority. We got plenty of food now, but we also got plenty of hungry mouths to feed, and you said it, that food will run out soon if we don't keep it coming in. But the people, they will leave, no? Not yet. There's still loads of infected out there, and they don't feel safe enough yet. We keep pushing them and take what we can for now. When the time is right, we can back off and give a little. This is, uh, how you say, uh, the planning? Strategy. Maddox answered as she nodded in understanding. We give in now and they'll want more and more. It's human nature. We stay hard now, take everything and get them scared. We'll know when it's time to change. But you kill people when they don't pay? She asks in the same open tone, a look of genuine puzzlement on her face bringing Maddox to a stop. He stared into her eyes, seeing no sign of challenge but a proud woman wanting to know why. This wasn't our fault. We didn't cause this. The boss man reacted quick enough to make the compound and fill it with food. He was already doing the job of the parents to these kids. It was him they came to when they needed help. Him they turned to. Not just him, no? I think it was you too. Yeah, maybe, but we got this secured and built. We got the food. We killed the infected while they hid. They saw us out there fighting. And they could have come out and helped. They didn't. If we let them in, they'll try and rule it and fuck it up. Yeah, we kill when they don't pay. We killed a man today. He watches her face closely, but she shows no reaction. He didn't pay. I warned him, but he came out fighting, so we killed him. He had plenty of food that will feed this lot for a while. He was old, and he had a choice. And his death will tell others who we are. You get me? You talk in different ways. 
You're like onion with the layers, no? Onion? I ain't no fucking onion blood. Swear down, bruv, innit? He replied quickly with an easy wry smile. Lenski watched his passive face and the deeply intelligent eyes. This youth was a natural leader, and she observed that he chose his clothes carefully too. Going for black but not too baggy jeans and a plain white t-shirt that accentuated his powerful shoulders. No hooded top either. His hair short but not shaved, no baseball cap or head covering, features open and watchful, never letting his face betray his mind. Walking back in the gate to an excited buzz of cheering and youths gathering, flooding round Maddox, yelling he was the man and that punch was bad. Maddox took the compliments well, smiling and taking high fives before starting to stride out a few steps and waving his arms to motion them to be silent. Listen up! His voice barely raised, quieted the last of the chattering youths. This is our base for us. Ain't no more foes coming in here and taking our shit. We the feds now, bruv, you get me? His simple words, spoken in a language they understood, keyed them up into a frenzy as they cheered loudly. Waving his arms for silence, he saw Darius smiling at him, nodding in compliment. Right, we having a party here, innit? We got tunes, food... Liquor and some nice smoke from the boss man's own private collection. Another cheer sounding out as the children bounce up and down. But listen up, listen up. Maddox raised his voice slightly and the intense look on his face made them fall silent within seconds. I need you to do something for me. If we're going to run this ship, we need to be clean, innit? Some of you stink worse than the pigs. Some laughs sound out as they soak his words up. I want my crews clean, you get me? You get clean before you get to party. Darius, you get the crew chiefs with me, blood. Lenski too. The rest of you, do one and get some water. As the crowd dispersed, Maddox knew he timed it perfectly. The youths, after seeing him lay that man out, would have stripped off there and let him hose them down if he'd asked. Hero worship in their eyes, young faces looking up and adoring him. What's up, Maddox? Darius asked as they stepped aside to speak quietly, Sierra and Lenski both watching him as the crew chiefs gathered round. Nothing. You? Maddox gave the instant reply. Nothing, Darius replied. The boss man said we gotta clean him up, innit? They get dysentery and we're fucked, Maddox explained and stopped as he saw the puzzled looks on more than a few faces. It's a disease, innit? Soldiers get it when they don't wash properly. You get the proper shits and die. Maddox exaggerated what he'd been told, but knowing he needed to get the seriousness across. Sierra, you and Lenski get the girls done. Make sure they're washed proper, innit? You get me? Yeah, Sierra nodded. We get shower gel and shampoo, innit? Where are we doing this, Maddox? Here. Lenski pointed to the side of a unit. We got some, uh Screens? Maddox helped her find the word. We got screens, no? Stop the boys looking at the boobs, she smiled. The water, it cold, but the sun, it is hot, no? Boys around the other side then, by the drains. We get screens up too. This ain't no PE lesson for piss taking, you get me? Maddox stared round the male faces, lingering on Riker for a few seconds. It's all good, bruv, Riker shrugged and nodded. Swear down. Maddox warned them. Some of them boys is young, innit? We ain't no fucking teachers been all pervy. Let them get clean in private. Girls too, Lenski matched Maddox's glare. You keep boys away or I take the gun and shoot them in the balls. Her hard tone taken with her fierce glare caused a few sniggers, but the point was made. Tonight, Maddox continued, they can chill out and get caned, but we stay on it. Darius, Jagger, Ryland, Mohammed, Sierra, Skylar, Lenski, you're with me. No booze, no weed. The rest of you chill out, but stay sharp. Who you putting on the gate? Mohammed asked. A thick-set youth of sixteen with a serious face. We doing it. Take it in turns, innit, you get me? Maddox replies. He was going to pick Riker for sentry duty too and make him stay straight, but after the last few days, Maddox wanted the lad to feel safe enough to unwind and see how he would react. Maybe provide an opportunity to sort him out properly. Questions, Maddox asked, and instantly regretted it. With the crews being so young, he forgot the crew chiefs were only slightly older and still youths themselves. 
trying to find their feet and learn as they went along. Questions were thrown at Maddox and he did his best to answer all of them. Lensky stepping in and taking a few off him, notes made on her clipboard and telling many of them she would sort it out. Several minutes later, the chiefs were filing away, talking amongst themselves, leaving Maddox and Lensky alone. Skylar, she like you, no? Lensky asked, straight to the point as usual. Yeah, I guess, Maddox replied. You like her? She very pretty. She make the eyes at you all the time. I saw that, Maddox grimaced, remembering how Sierra pulled the zip lower and lower on her hooded top to show her overdeveloped cleavage thrusting out from her low-cut top. The 16-year-old girl was beautiful, but that was it. She was 16, and although Maddox was but two years older, somehow it felt wrong. And the boobs, I thought maybe she'd take them out, Lensky stayed straight-faced, making Maddox laugh. I think she young for you. You need the real woman. She winked before turning away with a swish of hair, exaggerating a sexy hip swing and looking back to make sure he was watching, laughing at his evident surprise. The youths were separated, boys being taken to the far side by the large drains built into the ground and the girls led away to the front. Screens taken from the cannabis plantation and previously used to block the view from the grimy windows are taken outside and erected as large makeshift shower cubicles. Hoses used to water the plants are dragged out and fixed to the side of the screen. Grumbling, moaning, whining and making excuse after excuse, the boys lined up as Maddox made the crew chiefs go first, telling them quietly to show they're enjoying it. Taking it to the next level, the chiefs stripped off one by one and sang their way through the quick shower. Rap songs to start off with quickly changed into any tune remembered. And within minutes, a competition was started with points awarded by the crowd for the song Belted Out. The water was freezing, but as Lenski said, the sun was hot. Before long, the ground was foaming from the liberal amounts of shower gel and shampoo scrubbed and sluiced off. With not enough towels to go around, Maddox ordered them to dry off quickly before getting dressed and stretched the towels out on the hot ground. Darius, showing as good initiative, quickly inspects the clothes left by the showering youths and orders the filthiest to be set aside for washing. Those without new clothes were taken aside by Mohammed and Ryland to be supplied with new garments taken from the looted shops. Round the other side of the units, the girls fared much better. Naturally inclined to be cleaner than teenage boys, the girls relished the chance to wash, and each one took several minutes to scrub and wash their hair. A second hose was dragged out, and some of the more confident girls showered two at a time, chattering and laughing about the boys, who fancies who, and badgering Lenski for new clothes and makeup. Within an hour, the youths were clean for the first time in days, and Maddox stared glumly at the pile of filthy garments left over, then shaking his head as the girls filter back round, followed by Lenski and Sierra carrying armfuls of dirty clothes, quickly dumped onto the already huge mound. So I will be cleaning these too, Lenski asked with a challenging look. Maddox stared back and shrugged, suddenly feeling out of his depth for the first time since it began. Picking up on the subtle change in his eyes, Lenski quickly smiled. It's not big problem, we clean them. Okay, Maddox smiled back. The resilient lad was used to looking after himself, using laundries to get his own clothing washed and taking care over his appearance. But suddenly, having to sort out the laundry for so many filthy kids' clothes was too much. They need burning, Sierra added with a grimace. Punishment detail, Maddox said quietly, then looked to the two women. We use it as punishment when they fuck up. Might work, Sierra nodded. It's better than my girls doing it, Lenski agreed. Maddox, is Lenski a crew chief? Sierra suddenly asked an innocent question that showed her young age. Being unable to just accept the situation fluidly and needing the rank structure laid out clearly. No, Lenski is in charge of the base when I'm not here, Maddox replied in a tone that did not invite further conversation. So does that mean she's number three then? Sierra asked, clearly showing she missed the tone that didn't invite further conversation. I am not numbered. Lenski interrupted, annoyed at being spoken about like she wasn't there. The boss man is one, Maddox is number two, so you must be free, innit? 
Sierra said, as if it made the most perfect sense. Yes, Maddox said with a glance at Lenski. Yay! Sierra quickly hugged the startled Polish woman and walked off, beaming, telling Darius that Lenski was number three now. Nice one! Darius shouted over and set about telling more people, who in turn told more people, who then stared back at Lenski, smiling. I am not number, Lenski grumbled to Maddox. You are now, Maddox replied. You just got promoted. Do I get the pay rise too? Lenski nodded at the grinning youths as the latest gossip that Lenski was number three whipped through the camp. Yeah, you get more weed, Maddox joked, knowing Lenski, like him, didn't smoke it. I never try, she replied. Never. I never do the drugs. Is it nice? They like it, Maddox shrugged. Do you like it? Nah, I like being in control, Maddox replied. Yes, I see that. They'll want to know who number four is next, then five and down to the last one. Three is enough. For now, Maddox said, his mind already working ahead and seeing the power struggles that could break out as the youths clambered for authority over the rest. They'll want deputy crew chiefs, assistant crew chiefs and someone in charge of the toilet. You remind me now, we need more toilets. There is only a few here. I know, Maddox replied. Add it to the list. I did that already. They stand in silence, two young people drawn together and watching a new society form right in front of them. One, a hardened black youth, takes everything in, watching the subtle behaviours that shape the culture already developing. The other, a young woman from a different country, clutching a clipboard and blowing a stray strand of hair from her eyes, seeing tasks that need to be done, making lists and nodding to herself as she mentally ticks them off. Rats and cockroaches, Maddox says quietly. Where? Lenski looked at the ground in alarm. Us. We're rats and cockroaches. There was something the boss man told me that the only things that would survive a nuclear war would be rats and cockroaches. He shrugged. That's us. I am not a rat, Lenski exclaimed. Cockroach, then, Maddox smiled. I give you the cockroach, I put them in your bed, she said, laughing before walking away with another disdainful look at the mound of stinking clothes. Food is prepared by the girls in the units, helped out here and there by the younger youths drawn to the older women by a sense of being near someone maternal and caring. The power is taken from the lighting units set up above the plants and diverted to the game station and monitors. Music decks and speakers are dragged out near the pit, wires stretching back inside the units. Youths gather and congregate as a sense of excitement grows. Playlists are formulated and arguments break out over who is going first on the decks. With many budding DJs, all wanting to display their skills, Darius and Mohammed are forced to step in and resolve the disagreements by pushing the youths back and organising a list. The prepared food is given out one crew at a time as they withdraw to their tents to eat together, a rule enforced by Maddox to prevent squabbling and all-out carnage. Peace descends for a short time, giving the older youths and crew chiefs a chance to get the final touches ready. Some old disco lights are stretched round the pit, some of the plant UV lights stacked here and there, then into the units to gather up the pre-wrapped lumps of weed. Taken round to the tents by Maddox and Darius, each youth given enough to see them through the night. Maddox, never before feeling any sense of guilt about supplying the weed and taking the cash for it, feels a deepening sense of shame and worry. Young kids, some of them barely ten years old, reach out to take the cannabis in their small hands, smiling with red, tired-looking eyes. Children given a drug to keep them passive and quiet. He understands the thought process that having so many young people ripped away from whatever fucked-up family life they had and shoving them into an area with no real care or love is a recipe for disaster. But giving them drugs to keep them docile? Is this the right thing to do? Confused at the new thoughts creeping into his mind, Maddox moved from tent to tent, seeing the way the young look up to him, eager for a few words or something said by Maddox that would mean he's noticed them. He takes his time and mentions each youth by name, 
telling them they're doing a good job, mentioning a joke heard about them, or a boy or girl he saw watching them. He takes it easy with the shy ones, speaking quieter and with a soft tone, hardening his jokes and banter with the more rough and ready lads. The girls make eyes at him, zips get pulled down and cleavages pushed out. He pretends not to notice and keeps eye contact, smiling, joking, sharing stories and listening to their tales. As he steps out of the last tent, his eyes move back to the end of the units, where the boss man's office is. Knowing the great man will be sat inside smoking a joint and jotting down his yields, power output, water usage, and leaving everything to Maddox. Wondering if the boss man will make an appearance tonight, Maddox heads back towards the pit and the final touches being put to the decks. The boss man got all this set up. He moved quickly while everyone else stood with their mouths hanging open and hid under their beds, but for the last few days he stayed in his rooms. The afternoon draws into evening. A palpable, dual sense of nervous excitement spreads through the compound. Worry that the night will draw the infected out, if they will hear the howls tonight, if any of them will charge at the gates or fence. But looking forward to dancing, drinking, smoking weed and getting caned. As the night started to fall, Maddox stood at the top of the compound on the corner of the building line, maintaining a view of the tents the building and the front gate as the sun dropped below the line of council houses. The crew chiefs, spotting him looking into the sky, signal for their crews to be silent. Faces go taut and look up. Youths moved out from the tents to stand in silence. Maddox swiftly checked the gate, nodding to Darius, stood there holding an old rifle. Lensky and the girls, on hearing the sudden drop in noise, emerged from the open door and stand in silence. Worried expressions etched onto their tired faces. Lensky holds her clipboard to her chest. Maddox knows the area has been swept clean, and nearly every house in the nearby vicinity has been checked, but the worry that they could have shuffled back into the streets, and now with the daylight fading they could turn and come after the smell of fresh, tender young meat. Long minutes ticked away. In the built-up urban area, and without a view of the natural horizon, it was impossible to tell when the sun was down and the night was properly upon them. But still they waited as the sky grew darker with each passing second. No howls sounded out, ripping the air apart. Silence everywhere. With a prearranged signal, Maddox nodded at Mohammed on the decks. He flicked a switch, lights flashed on, and the solid bass beat stormed out from the speakers. The youths, still looking up at the sky, jump and twitch, spinning round to look at the grinning Mohammed and the multicoloured lights. Ryland, on seeing the signal, drops a match into the pit and steps back as the long flames shoot up from the petrol-soaked logs already stacked in place. Cheering erupts and the youths surge forward, the now clean and scrubbed faces bursting with relief and the absolute belief that if Maddox says it's safe, then it must be. Seconds later, the young boys and girls are jumping round, releasing the anxiety. The older ones hold back and saunter in casually, trying to look cool and show a sense of not being bothered. Hearing laughing, Maddox turns to see Lensky and the girls all smiling and pointing at the dancing youths. She smiles a huge grin at Maddox, offering a little wave. He nods back and turns to see Darius intently staring out through the gap, peering down the street. So you're going to get with Skylar then, bruv? Darius asked his friend as they stood by the main gate a few minutes later. Nah, mate, Maddox shook his head. She's fit, in it? Darius observed. Yeah, but not my style, Maddox said. Lensky? Darius asked, watching closely for a reaction, knowing his friend's ability to stay completely straight-faced. Nah, bruv, too busy, in it? Swear down we got too much going on here, Maddox replied. You see the boss man? Darius changed subject, being reminded of how busy Maddox was. He, almost as much as the boss man, knew how capable Maddox was and how much the compound now relied on him. Earlier, Maddox shrugged. He still sat inside with his toque. Yeah, in it, Maddox smiled. He coming out tonight or what? Darius asked, wondering along with everyone else why the boss man was keeping to his office so much. He won't, Maddox said. Is he all right then? Dunno. He seemed all right, but just sits inside smoking weed and working out the yields and crops, Maddox replied. Darius inhaled sharply, as though it was a bad thing Maddox had said. 
He's leaving it all to you, bruv. We need him, Maddox said quickly, wanting to dispel any stupid idea that might be forming in his friend's mind. He knows more than us, he got this place sorted, and he said about the dysentery. We don't know stuff like that. Fact, Darius quickly sided with Maddox, picking up on his quick reply and wanting to show he didn't mean anything. You hungry, bruv? Go get some food and I'll stay here. Sure, Darius checked before starting to stroll off. Watch Riker, Maddox called out. I don't like that kid, he's trouble, innit? I'm all over it. Darius raised an arm and was soon lost in the deep shadows. Alone, Maddox leant against the gate and thought once more about the scaffold tower they need to be able to see over the gate instead of peering through the gap. One of the garden centres nearby should have something they could use. Then he thought to the local shops and the scaffolding rigged up round one of them while work was being carried out. Just take that, he mused quietly. Get the crews to carry it back. Need some lights out here. Too dark now the street lamps are gone. Spotlights or something on the top of the scaffold tower like the guard towers have in the movies. The beat of the music drifted round to him and Maddox found himself humming along with the tune being played. The estate was huge, covering miles of social housing and run-down streets, bordered on two sides by fields and open countryside that was rarely ventured into and cut off by strong, high metal fencing. An agreement worked out by the farmers before the project was started. The north side was cut off by the motorway and the south by the shore. Those houses on the shore were nice and kept by for the families that proved they could look after their properties. Thoughts poured through his mind, working out ways to maximise the area. He could use the school playing fields to plant crops and maybe get some of the crews down on the shore catching fish. He knew there were still hordes of the infected gathered about, but eventually they would be killed off. More might come, but they would be dealt with too. Thinking back to the conversation he had with Lenski earlier, he wondered how he knew what he knew. The boss man had taught him many things, but most of it was down to Maddox growing up on the streets and learning quickly, striving to drag himself out of the benefit-dependent life that everyone else seemed to cling to. He knew the risks of dealing, but took those risks knowing it was the quickest way to get money, status, and then get out and be somewhere else. He wasn't drawn to the world of gangster. He wanted out, and that was the way to do it. But now, now it was all gone, and out of necessity, he was left holding the baby. There was no reason why some of these houses couldn't be converted to house the cannabis plants. Put solar panels on the roof, then use the space in the units for living in when the weather got bad. He thought the boss man wouldn't like that idea being away from his babies. But if they extended the compound out to take in the houses, then they would be safe and maybe use a few of them to live in too. In time, they could keep extending the fence and barricade out and create a big compound, but then the adults would want in. More adults meant more problems, and it would mean having to make more deputies, more helpers, more guards, more guns than it was back to the shit community that was here before. The great leader should be with the people, no? Lenski said, interrupting his thoughts and holding out a mug of steaming black coffee. Not sure if she meant him or the boss man. He simply took the coffee and smiled. Are you hungry? She asked. No, I had some in before. We take out the crisps and snacks, you said. They go mad and eat them like pigs. Everywhere it smell of the weed and they're drinking the beer too. A mess in. Maddox asked, imagining the chaos that would be reigning on the other side of the units. But they enjoy it, she added. The little ones are dropping off. Riker? Maddox looked at the woman, his meaning clear. Ah, he is loud, Lenski nodded. He's shouting and making noise and I heard him shouting with Mohammed. What about? I not know this. The music is too loud, no? But Darius, he speak and make him calm. Okay. So what you'll do here alone? She asked quietly. Thinking we can move the fence out and take in those houses. Maddox nodded to the nearby buildings. Be better when the weather gets colder. It is good plan, she nodded. Maddox! Mohammed sprinted round the corner, shouting in alarm. Rike has gone fucking nuts, innit? He's got a blade out! Take this and stay here. Maddox thrust the shotgun at a startled Lenski who held the foreign object at arm's length. What I do? 
Point and pull the trigger, Maddox shouted, already running after Mohammed. He expected Riker to do something stupid. In fact, he was banking on it so he could sort the lad out properly, but pulling a blade is serious. A thin layer of smoke rests gently on the warm air above the open ground, caused by the fire burning from the pit and the joints being puffed continually. The constant bass beat of the music abruptly ceases as he charges past Mohammed towards the crowd gathered round the far side of the pit, all turned away and watching something blocked from Maddox's view. Pushing his way through, Maddox breaks out from the crowd and Riker stands holding a long knife, fresh blood dripping from the blade and soaking his hand. His eyes look wild, feral. Darius stood in front of him, pointing his rifle at Riker and shouting for the youths behind him to move. Sierra edging in closer, also with her weapon, pointing at the frenzied-looking lad. Drop the blade! Darius's voice booms out, the pitch higher and showing his young age. Fuck you! I swear down I'll shank you up! Riker screamed back, spittle flying from his lips as he backed away, eyes darting left and right. Maddox stepped round Darius and spotted Zayden lying on the ground his small hands clutching the bleeding wound in his stomach and crying quietly, whimpering for help. Pull him away, Maddox shouted at the closest youths, pointing at Zayden. Get him inside and get something on him to stop him bleeding. Maddox, unarmed and glaring with wide eyes, pushed past Darius to step in front of Riker. What did you do? he roars. Riker fixed his eyes on Maddox. Fear flitted across his face and he raised the knife higher, pointing it at Maddox. You fucking dissed me, innit? Riker shouted defensively. He's a fucking kid! Maddox bellowed back. New rules, blood! I ain't getting dissed by no one! Riker sneered, waving the blade at Maddox. His drug and alcohol fueled brain buzzes with adrenaline. The sudden ending of his medication for severe hyperactivity sending him steadily spiralling. Boundaries blurring as the position of crew chief boosts his self-image, propelling his behaviour to plummet as he desperately tries to show his crew how ruthless and hard he is. Zayden, the small, terrified lad, sat near him smoking weed and drinking vodka, trying to show Lauren he can hang with the bigger boys. As the banter got worse, he tried to keep up, using swear words he'd never normally use until he crossed the line and laughingly called Riker a twat. He overstepped the mark and he had to be dealt with. Riker, desperate not to lose face, confronted him with a violent outburst of temper, demanding he say sorry. Zayden laughed for a couple of minutes before realising the other youths were backing away in fear and leaving him isolated in front of the raging crew chief. He did apologise, despite feeling the shame in front of the terrified Lauren. But the damage was done, and nothing Zayden could have said or done would change the outcome. Riker needed to prove himself, so he pulled the blade from his waistband and shoved the pointed end deep into Zayden's soft stomach. Screams erupted as Riker pulled the knife out and held the trembling child by one hand before shoving him to the ground with a look of disgust. Expecting a cheer for his actions, Riker was confused when he was suddenly surrounded with everyone yelling at him and Darius pointing his rifle. You is a scrawny little prick, Maddox said through gritted teeth. The silence became profound as the youths flicked their eyes between the standoff. You hear me, Riker? I said you was a scrawny little prick. I'm dissing you, Riker. Calling you out, bruv, innit? Fuck you, Maddox! Riker screamed back, feeling a sense of fear creeping up inside. Scrawny! Maddox drew the word out, dragging the sound so everyone could hear. Little prick, innit? Shank a little kid, you're a pussy, bruv! Maddox stepped forward his arms down at his sides. Riker backed up, waving the blade at the advancing figure. You ain't a crew chief no more. You clean in the toilets now, innit? You gotta clean everyone's shit up. I'll make you wear a dress and call you Nancy. Fuck off! Riker screamed, his face contorting with rage. Nancy! Maddox goaded him. Fuck off! Nancy! Just fuck off! Riker's words flew from his mouth as he lunged forward and swiped the blade at Maddox, who simply blocked the swing and gripped Riker by the wrist, twisting viciously and causing the blade to drop from his paralysed hand.
Maddox pulled his fist back and repeatedly slammed the hard knuckles into Riker's screaming face. Writhing and trying to break free, Riker desperately twisted and turned, Maddox stepping round with him and sending punch after punch into his face. The hard blows splitting his lips open, cracking teeth, breaking his nose, fracturing eye sockets, and still he didn't stop. As Riker dropped down, Maddox went with him using two hands to rain blow after blow into his head. Riker slipped into unconsciousness as Maddox grasped him by his collar and started dragging him over towards the big drains. Ditching the twitching form on the ground, he turned and pulled the shotgun from Sierra, opening the weapon and checking each barrel before slamming it shut. Without a break in his stride, he walked back pointed the weapon at Riker's head and pulled the trigger. The booming retort rolled round the enclosed camp as Riker's head eviscerated, leaving a bloody stump and pink mist hanging in the air. A single piercing scream erupted from deep within the crowded youths, young faces squeezing eyes closed, tears streaming down soft cheeks. No one spoke. No one moved. Maddox turned round and stood facing the crowd as he quickly opened the breech and ejected the spent cartridge, instinctively pulling a new one from his pocket, ramming it home and snapping the weapon closed. Handing the gun back to Sierra, he addressed the youths. He had it coming! Maddox's voice carried loud and clear. But he was right about one thing. These are new rules. We don't have the feds now. No courts and no trials. If anyone does shit like that, they can expect the same. His street language slipped, but not one youth noticed as they stared at their leader, hanging from his awful words. I will take care of you, and we will all take care of each other. We are family. But that, he pointed at the bloodied corpse, is bad shit. We don't use weapons on each other. If we have an issue, we sort it out. You all watched Riker shank Zayden. You could have stopped him, but you was all too stoned. Maddox shook his head, knowing they would have been too terrified to confront the crazed Riker, but using the time to ram a point home. Too much weed will fuck you up, he continued, and we don't mix weed with booze. Party's over. Get this cleaned up and no weed for the next few nights. Maddox knew the boss man wouldn't like the ban but he did say he was in charge. The crew chiefs moved in swiftly, breaking the crowd apart and ushering them away. Muted chatter filled the air. The shock of the event was palpable. Maddox swept his eyes across the crowd, coming to rest on the soft orange glow coming from the open door to the units. The boss man stood in silhouette, watching the proceedings while puffing away on his joint. Maddox stared back as the orange glow came back again. Then the boss man was gone, moving back to his quarters and leaving Maddox to deal with everything again. Lenski appeared coming round the building, her hands free from the clipboard for the first time in days. She walked straight at Maddox and stopped when she saw the bloodied headless cadaver on the ground. Taking the sight in with a glance, she portrayed no reaction, simply staring at Maddox with an intense gaze. Zayden got stabbed in the stomach, Maddox said quietly. Where is he? Lenski asked with sudden concern. They took him inside, Maddox replied to the already running form of Lenski sprinting for the door. She pushed her way through the youths and disappeared inside. I got this, bruv, Darius said from nearby and motioning his head towards the dead body. Do what you gotta do, we'll get it cleared up. Maddox nodded and walked quickly after Lenski the crowd parting as the poker-faced man walked through and entered the gloom of the units. Inside, he made his way through the building to the lights in the rear section with the adult plants. Zayden laid out on blankets, the tiny body looking more like the child he was than ever before. His top pulled up to show the bright red blood making his skin look pale and white, the body inert, the chest not rising or falling. Maddox stops inches from his head and looks down to the pale face and the eyes staring lifelessly up at him. From this angle, it looks like Zayden is staring straight into Maddox's eyes. He survived the apocalypse, only to die on the filthy floor of a drugs factory.
stabbed to death by a teenager high on drugs and booze. Streaks of tears mark the child's face, forming clean lines through the dirt. The blood on his hands is red and wet, glistening from the lights shining on the plants. Thoughts burn through Maddox's mind, spiralling and plummeting, but still his face remains expressionless. Not one kid had been lost since this began. There had been injuries, sprains, cuts, but not one of them had been bitten. But right here and now, staring down at the lifeless form of a child, bled out from a needless single stab to the stomach, makes him feel dirty. What do we do now? Lenski stood up, wiping the blood from her hands on a rag. We bury him, Maddox replied. Where? Here. No, we need the ground for crops, not here. Where then? Somewhere else. Is there a church here? Yeah, and a synagogue and a mosque, but no ground on any of them, just buildings. Somewhere. Do you know his house? Yeah. It has garden? No, he lived in a council flat. At the school, then? We need the field for crops, too. And he hated school. They all did. I not know, Lenski sighed, dropping her head. Wrap the bodies in refuse bags and sheets. Put them in the sentry hut. Okay, I do this. Where are you going? To see the boss man. Maddox walked away. Shoulders brushing against the leaves of the plant, stretching out to absorb the light shining down. Sweat on his head shining from the heat and humidity. He walked through the units, reaching the door of the boss man's room, walking straight in without pause. The lights off and the room reeked of cannabis. Heavy smoke hung in the air, stinging his eyes and catching in his throat. The soft orange glow ignites from the chair behind the desk as the boss man inhaled another drag of his joint. Maddox stands feet from the desk, his anger and hurt suddenly abating from the shock of finding the boss man sat alone in the dark. His eyes slowly adjust to the gloom as the light from the still open door permeates the room. The silhouette of the boss man forms gradually, sat back in his chair and staring straight at Maddox, waiting in silence. Is he dead? The boss man asked, his voice low and hoarse from the harsh smoke. Yes. Maddox replied. Silence descended again, oppressive and charged. The end of the joint flares as another drag is taken. The boss man exhaled slowly, smoke spiralling from his mouth. Riker stabbed him, Maddox added. So you shot Riker. The boss man's reply is instant and challenging. He stabbed Zayden, Maddox replied equally as quickly. So that makes you jury judge and executioner, does it? What? You're a killer. The statement is tinged with a very slight slur, but the tone is dangerously low. We've all killed, Maddox said. The infected don't count, the boss man said. So what should I have done? Maddox asked after a long pause. I've been watching you, Maddox, watching how they come running to you. They didn't come to me when Riker stabbed Zayden. They ran to you. You put me in charge. I've been on the ground with them for the last few days. So that makes you number one now, does it? What? No. Seems like it to me, Maddox the Great. Doesn't smoke weed, doesn't drink. Holier than fucking now, ain't you? Boss, you sold this shit and made money, but you never touched it. Never like being out of control, did you, Maddox? Now look at you. Got a whole camp running at your every whim. Shooting little kids in the face. Boss! Go and wash, my boys and girls. Go and eat vegetables, my boys and girls. Don't smoke drugs, my little children. I am Maddox. I'm fucking better. Boss, please! Maddox asked, his tone low and still unable to see the boss man clearly in the dark shadows. What? The boss man suddenly asked. What do you want from me? Riker was bad. We talked about it earlier. You told me to watch him. He fucking stabbed Zayden. He had to go. Go? What? Go where, Maddox? Where did you send him? Boss, you know what I meant. We couldn't kick him out. He's too dangerous and could have whipped up support from the survivors on the estate. We had to sort him. We, Maddox. We did that, did we? We decided to shoot him, did we? You were watching. 
You could have said something. Say something to the mighty Maddox. You might have decided to shoot me with the other barrel. I wouldn't do that, Maddox said softly. The boss man was stoned out of his mind, slurring, but his voice was hard. Maddox had never seen him like this, never seen him showing the effects of cannabis and never drunk. Coming after me next, are you? No, boss. Wanna be number one, eh, my lad? No! Numero uno. Maddox the numero uno, the boss man giggled suddenly, the wheezing of his chest clearly audible. Boss, I'll come back later. No, the boss man snapped, stopping Maddox as he turned to the door. You overstepped the mark, boy. Who were you to tell them not to smoke weed? The slur of his tone ends as he spits the words out. They needed a break. Don't speak back to me, the boss man growled. I'm the boss here, Maddox. I make the rules. It seems you've gotten a bit too big for your boots, my lad. The boss man rose from the chair, stubbing the joint out and easing himself round the desk. Pausing briefly to gain his balance from wobbling on unsteady feet, he walked round to stand directly in front of Maddox. Closer now, Maddox can see his eyes are vacant from the weed and his face looks drawn. Standing face to face, the boss man slapped Maddox round the face. Once. Hard. The sound ringing out and causing Maddox to flare his eyes. With gritted determination, he stands his ground and shows no reaction. Come on, Maddox. The boss man reeked of tobacco, alcohol and weed, breathing foul breath into Maddox's face. Come on in, boy, he goaded again, pushing Maddox in the chest. Feeling a rare surge of anger, Maddox squeezes his hands into fists at the side of his body, tensing his muscles and staring straight ahead. You know what you are, Maddox, the boss man leant in, millimetres from the youth's face, purposefully breathing a low blast of fetid air into his eyes. Maddox held his rage in check. Hard lessons learnt from a hard life, and every ounce of strength pitted against showing a reaction. You know what you are, boy. The boss man poked Maddox in the chest with the end of one finger, prodding his pectoral muscle and forcing him back a step. Seeing the reaction... The boss man repeated it, prodding harder and forcing Maddox back again. I'm going to tell you what you are. He poked his digit hard into the muscle, forcing Maddox to half turn as he stumbled back, quickly regaining his balance and breathing deeply. You are a jumped up street nigger. The atmosphere changed instantly as Maddox whipped his head round to glare straight into the eyes of the suddenly frightened boss man. His fists clenched and he exhaled once. The rage driven into cold fury, and he lashed out hard, driving those already bloodied knuckles into the boss man's face. The boss man reeled back, slamming into the desk and crying out in a strangled yell. Scrabbling furiously on the desk, the boss man brought his knee up hard into Maddox's groin. He flinched back enough for the boss man to roll away, falling with a thump to the floor and crashing into the chair he was using just seconds before. Recovering quickly, Maddox knew this had to end. The boss man won't stop now. His pride, his power, his survival hinges on beating Maddox. Both men knew the prize at hand and the forfeit if they lost. Maddox launched himself over the top of the wide desk, intent on landing on the older man and finishing the job. The boss man, suddenly alert and realising the danger, grabbed at the pistol grip poking out of the open drawer. Maddox slammed into him, driving him down into the ground and forcing the air from his lungs. The boss man, in reaction, tensed his hands and pulled the trigger of the pistol not seen by Maddox. The gunshot deafened them both in the enclosed room. The ricochet pinging off followed instantly by the sound of splintering wood. Maddox reacted quickly. Now knowing his employer and mentor was holding a gun, he drove the back of his elbow into the boss man's skull. His face slammed hard against the floor, nose breaking as the boss man screamed with agony, pulling the trigger again and desperately trying to buck the youth off. Maddox slammed his elbow down again and went for the gun reaching out with both hands to grip the pistol and twisting round to drive his feet repeatedly into the boss man's head and neck. The gun fired again as the boss man tried to desperately empty the magazine before Maddox gained control of the weapon. Gunshot after gunshot rang out as they fought, kicking, writhing and screaming with terrified rage. 
Maddox lifted his foot and slammed the heel down on the side of the boss man's face, breaking the cheekbone. The grip on the pistol loosened enough for Maddox to twist it free from his hand. Losing the gun and screaming in terror, the boss man rolled away as Maddox fumbled with the weapon, got his hand on the grip and his finger on the trigger, and fired point-blank range into the solid mass of the boss man. Two shots ripped through his upper body, and the third made a small, neat entry into his cheek and took the back of his head off. Skull, brains and blood sprayed out in a wide arc coating the wall. Maddox stayed in position, breathing hard and hardly believing what had just happened. His ears were ringing from the gunshots. The stench of cordite and cannabis made his eyes water. The boss man lay dead just a few feet from him, the back of his head gone. Slowly, he lowered the pistol and gave silent thanks for the lessons the boss man had given him, showing him how to load, clean and fire the different guns available on the black market. Using the desk, he levered himself up and stared down at the third person killed in the compound within the last few minutes, two of them from his own hands. Maddox, Lenski whispered. Leaning on the desk, he dropped his head and looked back at the door, and Darius, Sierra and Lenski stood there. He went for me. Maddox straightened up and turned towards them, the pistol held down at his side. We saw, Darius said quietly. Is he dead? Sierra asked, their view of the boss man blocked by the desk and the gloom. Yeah, Maddox replied, looking back at the corpse. Lenski entered first, carrying a large torch and shining it down onto the body. The other two filtered in behind her and stared down. After nine days of constant killing, neither of them flinched at the corpse, but they both reeled from the implication. I shouldn't have come in here. Maddox shook his head. I knew he'd be stoned, but not that much. Bruv, after what happened, you had to see him, innit? Darius said. He fucked up. Maddox, this is not your fault. He called you nigger and he hit you. He tried to shoot you. I know, Maddox breathed out deeply. How's everyone out there? You not worry, they good now. Did anyone else see it? Maddox asked, worrying if the news had yet spread. On seeing the nods, he groaned, knowing the camp would be buzzing and terrified from the killings and what it meant. Come on, he nodded as he moved towards the door. What do you do? Lenski reached out, pulling his arm back to turn Maddox round. We need to speak to everyone. Now? Darius cut in. Yeah, now. Maddox stared at Lenski, not wanting to pull his arm away by force. She dropped her hand and nodded, knowing it was the right thing to do. The four of them filed out of the room as the full weight of the consequences hit Maddox. This was his. His compound. These were his people. Ending it like this was wrong. But it had happened, and Maddox knew there was a secure compound of feral youths, drugs, booze and guns, and if he didn't act quickly, it would fall within hours. Lenski picked up on a similar train of thought herself. At first, she thought her and the other older girls had been allowed in to give sexual favours or services to the older lads and the boss man. But despite some clumsy, flirty comments from a few youths, not one of them had tried anything. Even the boss man had acted properly, and he could have taken what he wanted with impunity. Lenski had watched Maddox transform over the last few days. At first, he followed the boss man at every step, but now he made his own decisions with confidence. They walked through the units and passed the bloodstains on the ground, where Zayden had bled out before his body was removed. Youths were all through the units staring quietly as Maddox and the others walked through. They ran ahead and out the doors, alerting the others that Maddox was coming out. As they stepped out of the units and into the cooler night air, Maddox saw the fire in the pit was still burning and the music decks were being slowly dismantled. The atmosphere was electric as terrified faces stared at him, eyes wide with the shock of seeing Riker kill Zayden. Then Maddox killed Riker, and now hearing that the boss man had attacked Maddox. Maddox, leading Lenski, Darius and Sierra, moved over to the pit so the flames would illuminate him, making him visible to everyone. 
He stood silent for a few seconds, breathing deeply and staring down at the dancing flames. The smell of wood smoke was a blessed change from the reek of cannabis and pistol fire. The busman, he attacked Maddox. Lenski spoke out in a clear voice, surprising Maddox. I see this. Darius and Sierra, they see this too. He attack Maddox and call him the street nigger. Gasps sweep round as air is sucked in quickly. It wasn't the word used that made them gasp. The word was familiar to them in everyday language, as well as a thousand other insulting and extreme words. What made them prick up was that Maddox had been called it, and by the boss man. The boss man tried to shoot Maddox with the pistol, Lenski said. Maddox defend, and he kill the boss man. Audible gasps, mouths drop open, and eyes go wide as the rumour so freshly circulated and hardly believed, despite the gunshots, was so quickly and bluntly confirmed. Listen up, Maddox's deep voice boomed out. This happened, but it doesn't change anything for us. We still the same, and we carry on like we were. You still get food and clothes. We still run this estate, and this is still our base. The boss man was a good man, but the weed fucked him up. It made him paranoid and sick. Same with Riker. It fucks you up good and proper if you take it all the time. We've got a lot of work to do now. Are you in charge now, Maddox? One of the youths called out. You're the boss man now? Another voice added. I am in charge now, Maddox nodded. But I'm not the boss man. He's dead. I'm still Maddox. Do we still call you Maddox? The first voice called out again. Maddox smiled to himself at the thought that the youths need that authority to cling on to. Who is in charge? Who is boss? No, you got to call me Mr. Maddox, sir, now, innit, bruv? The youth laughed at the quick joke and Maddox, smiling. He looked normal to them. The same man they'd come to accept as their leader over the last days. The boss man was always spoken about, but it was Maddox who did all the work and they all knew it. It's Maddox, Maddox added quickly, before anyone could think it was his real name from now on. Get some rest, we'll sort this out and everything will be okay. Crew chiefs, come over here for a minute. Well, what you's looking at? Go on, get some rest. The youth shuffled away as the crowd broke up. The same Maddox as every other night, telling them to go to sleep and rest. Reassured that things seemed okay, they formed groups and talked quietly most of them still coming down from the weed smoke through the evening. Maddox waited until the crew chiefs were assembled round him, nodding at some of the youths hanging around too close, motioning them to move away with a warning smile. That was bang out of order, he calling you that, Skylar said, moving to stand close by Maddox and already pulling the zip down to show her heaving cleavage. That's fucking sweet that you're in charge now, Maddox, Ryland said with a grin. Yeah, Maddox nodded back. Listen, when the survivors on the estate found out the boss man is dead, they'll think we're weak, he explained, watching their faces. So they might come and try it on here, try and get in or take over. I want double guards on here, which means the crews will be smaller, so I want each crew to pair up with another one. The chiefs share the responsibility, and also I want one crew chief awake all the time and overseeing the guards. The chiefs listened intently as Maddox outlined the immediate changes, drawing up a list of watches starting from then and telling the chiefs he wanted them checking the gate and walking the compound too. As he spoke, more ideas started forming, more plans and the realisation that he could implement what he wanted now without having to check first. He held himself back from going through more, seeing the chiefs yawning and fidgeting. Eventually he sent them off, reminding them to stick to the watch list and report directly to him or Lenski if anything happened. Maddox took Ryland and Darius into the boss man's room and wrapped the heavy body in black bin bags before rolling him and the bits of him splattered about into a sheet and carrying him outside to join the other two bodies in the sentry hut. Finally, at some point during the early hours, he entered his room and collapsed exhausted on the bed. Staring up at the low ceiling, his mind a blur with the future and how things can be different, how he can make them different. Less drugs, better food, safer. Something about the deaths he caused and the emotions he felt sparked a thought process and awakened a sense of remorse about the survivors killed on the estate. 
They had to be dealt with, that much was for sure, but now after this night he realises that death was easy to give. If there is to be a future, then it should be a decent one. Otherwise, what's the point? Why go through all this just so they can kill more people? The sudden realisation that what they've been doing is wrong burns through his soul. This isn't the way. He knows this, but the thoughts become muddled and slip into visceral images spinning through his head as he drifts into the first layer of sleep. Images of Zayden stood out on the junction, holding his bleeding stomach while laughing about the box of condoms. The 18-year-old hardened criminal sleeps fitfully as he becomes the new leader of a community of drug-addicted kids and one with a sudden conscience. 3. Day 10. Sunday. Maddox wakes instantly from the loud knocking at his door, still dressed and flat on his back in the same position that he flaked out in just a few hours ago. Yeah, his voice sounds deep and ragged, unrecognised by his own ears. The door opens to show Lenski stood there, smiling and holding two steaming mugs. She's dressed in different clothes, jeans and a simple top. She looks clean and fresh. Everything okay? he asks quickly. Sure, sure, she waves her free hand gently, motioning him to stay put. I knew you want to be awake before the youths, yes? So I bring you coffee. Coffee. Maddox repeats the word dumbly before collapsing back down. He stretches his arms and legs out, groaning noisily. Shh, Lenski laughs. They will think we are doing the sex. She stands at the end of the bed, staring down as Maddox looks up quickly from the mention of the word sex from a beautiful woman stood in his room. Ha! That got you awake, she laughs again. Not funny, Maddox groans, sitting up and extending his hand for the coffee. She steps in and passes the cup, fingers brushing as his hands fumble to grip the hot ceramic mug. Thanks, he murmurs. She sits down next to him on the bed as he takes the first sip and rubs his face with his free hand. Suddenly aware of her close proximity and the downward pressure of her weight on the mattress. Last night it was crazy, no? She says quietly. Nuts, he replies. Anything happen overnight? Nothing. I took coffee out to the gate. Skylar, she was there. She does not like me, I think. Why not? Maddox asked and instantly regretted it, knowing the reason why. She like you, Lenski shrugs lightly. You spend the time so much with me, she not like this. She's young, Maddox mused. They all are. But not you. I'm only 21. That make me old, though, to the children. Ancient, Maddox answered quickly with a quick smile. You, I'm not ancient. She slaps his shoulder affectionately, leaving her hand there as she squeezes his hard muscle. Are you okay? She asks with a worried expression. About last night? Maddox answers, feeling her hand rubbing and enjoying the pleasurable feeling. Normally he'd flinch away from unwarranted contact from another person, but her manner makes him relax, and he doesn't sense anything other than care from the woman. No threat or clumsy flirting like with Skylar and the other girls. Of course, last night, she says, continuing the rub and staring across at him. Yeah, th yeah, it's okay, I think. Nothing we can do now, is there? Just gotta roll with it. Lenski picks up on him saying we and not I. No, nothing we can do. It done now, but I worry you feel bad for killing the boss man, and... He would have killed me. As soon as he said what he did, I knew it was on. There's no going back from something like that. He could have backed down. Or I could have, but it would have happened today or tomorrow. Getting fucked up on weed and sat on his own would have made him worse. And Riker? Lenski gently pushed the question, needing to know how Maddox was thinking about it now a night had passed. It's done, he says quietly. We can't lock people up here, and if we sent him away, he could have caused problems. He had to die after what he did. Zayden didn't deserve that. Maddox? she asks in a quiet voice. He turns to look into her eyes, her face looking soft instead of the normal hard stare. Maybe many they didn't deserve the killing. Maybe we not kill so many people now. 
I was thinking the same last night. They stare at each other, her hands still gently rubbing his back. We'll stop killing the survivors, but we've got to do it carefully. Why? Like I said, they might see losing the boss man as a sign of weakness. If we just suddenly stop killing and become nice, they'll be in here and taking us over. It needs to be done carefully. We still got a shitload of kids here that need protecting, and there's so much we don't know too. The boss man knew about the dysentery. None of us would know that. Not the word, maybe, we do not know, but being clean is obvious, no? There could be a hundred things like that we don't know about. Then we will find them, no? We make it work, Lenski says softly, her hands still gently massaging his back. Yeah, Maddox whispers, staring at her, the atmosphere suddenly becoming charged. Eyes locked on each other, they gently lean in, closing the gap. Two hearts hammering in two chests, two young minds drawn together. The youths, the chiefs, they all have Maddox and Lenski to take care of them. Maddox and Lenski have but each other, and the weight they feel is suddenly shared. Two people that moved in different circles, never associated and never knew the other existed. They may have crossed each other in the street with barely an appreciative glance at the other's attractive form, but that would have been it. After what seems an eternity, their lips brush and gentle kissing continues for long minutes as the heat between them builds. Still clutching their coffee mugs, they move to embrace and laugh when the contents slosh over the rims of the mugs. The brief diversion does nothing to end the moment as the cups are lowered and they fall back onto the bed. Kissing passionately, touching, caressing. The need for contact, for that thing of closeness that every human strives for. Not drunk, not stoned, not some random act taking place after a nightclub. Two people taking the lives of many in their hands and needing an escape. The constant state of extreme emotion, surrounded by death and suffering, vents as the pressure between them explodes into an urgent loving ecstasy. Maddox, for an 18-year-old male, is tender, loving and caressing. Knowing his hands are strong, he restrains himself, which sends shivers down Lenski's body. Her slim, athletic frame grips the hard muscles in his arms, feeling the ridges of his abdominal muscles, sensing his power, his aura, feeling safe and protected. He, in turn, feels nurtured and loved, and in a strange way, he also feels protected. The hardened young man knows his physical prowess and has worked hard to become strong and healthy, but with Lenski, he feels protected from the psychological draw of going back to what it was. With her understanding him, even for this short time, he feels empowered to try and change. Tenderness builds gradually until it becomes an urgent need, and they make love. Desire, wants and needs, emotions so powerful they cannot be expressed by words pour from them. Instinct moves them, propels them to action, the intrinsic need to progress the species tempered by the one thing that marks humanity apart from all else love. It's over in minutes, but it's enough for both of them. Enough to forge that contact and make that connection. A contract drawn between them of mutual respect, desire and genuine care. The sun's golden rays penetrate the once grimy window, wiped and scrubbed by Maddox so he could always have a sight of the world outside. Dust particles glint and dance as the warm air settles over the naked forms lying with entwined arms upon the small bed. The contrast between them is stark. The pale, slender curves of Lenski snuggling in close against the dark, defined frame of Maddox. They kiss more, stroking and smiling in the early morning light. Faint noises caused by the rustle of bedclothes, exhaling, and the soft sound of skin against skin. Delight in both their faces, eyes bright and searching, staring, gazes being held. They shuffle up to a seated position. Lenski reaches down with her slender arms to bring both their mugs up. The coffee, still warm, is sipped quietly as they manoeuvre to maintain the closeness, neither one wanting to break the spell. To the south, across an expanse of deep blue water, at the end of a long wooden pier, Howie and Lani clasp hands as they lay down to sleep, exhausted from battle and in need of that same contact, that same connection. 
fingers as entwined as the limbs of Maddox and Lensky. Humanity rolls on, awakening inside young hearts as love builds. Listen up! Maddox's voice booms out across the compound. Young, tired faces stare back, sipping the bottles of water handed out with the order to get them finished. Maddox stands tall and erect next to the pit, one foot raised on a log used for seating. Lensky nearby, holding her clipboard close to her chest and watching with pride as her lover commands every face within the base. No patrols today. Maybe later, but not now. We're going to extend the base. The houses either side of the road leading away from the base will be taken in and the fence will be pushed to the end of the junction. Then we're going to put the fence into the gardens at the end of the junction. They've got high walls all around them, so we will still get the protection, but we get more space. We will knock the garden walls down between here and the junction, so we make the ground open all the way to the end. That gives us more space for planting food to grow, and it gives us more privacy. The two houses on the end will be used as sentry point with guard rooms. That means we can use height to look down and see further. Maddox pauses briefly, drawing breath and making sure they're still watching him. The faces remain fixed, hanging off every word he says. Every crew will be given a job and the chief will make sure that job is done properly. It's going to be a hard day and we'll need one crew keeping guard. Make sure your weapons are close all the time. Anyone caught without their weapons nearby will be washing all the shit-smeared pants, you get me? That means you, Liam. The youths burst out laughing as Liam takes a deep bow, grinning happily at being named. Darius is moving up too, so that means we need two more crew chiefs. Work hard and we'll see who stands out today. That got their attention with the prospect of moving up to one of the coveted jobs. Maddox turns and nods the prearranged signal at Lensky, who steps forward, examining her clipboard. Sierra will take first guard out on the junction. Lensky looks up to see Sierra nodding back. She already knew parts of the plan and had been warned her crew would be first up for guarding. Darius will take his crew and Rikers to the shops down the road and bringing back the scaffold, please, yes? Skylar... Can you take your crew and start knocking down the walls into the gardens on the right side and Mohammed the left side? Alia, you will be taking crew with Jagger and Ryland and help with the moving the fence, yes? Questions? Are we going to live in the houses? Liam shouts. A good question, noticed by Maddox and Darius, and already a contender emerges for one of the crew chief slots. More questions get thrown up once Liam got his answer which was that they didn't know yet. Maddox and Lensky field most of the questions, with Darius stepping up to take one or two and asserting his role at the top of the table. Not one youth picks up on Maddox's change in manner, his use of normal speech instead of the usual street talk. Even Darius drops some of the slang in favour of trying to be like Maddox, noticed with a wry smile by Sierra. The crews move about, getting into their groups, as the serious work of the day begins. Confusion descends for the first few minutes as each chief is bombarded with more questions. They, in turn, seek out the new leaders to find out exactly how they're going to do what they're tasked with. The fence is the first thing once Sierra has moved out to the junction and staggered her crew out across the roads. The crews gather round and slowly figure out what tools are needed to detach the gates from the high fencing and the drilled bolts in the ground and then half dragging, half carrying the heavy loads down to the junction. Once they're sure the fence can be erected safely, only then does Maddox give the order for Skylar and Mohammed to start bashing the high brick walls down. Making sure they understand only to make enough room for two or three people to walk through, and no bigger. As the sun rises, so does the volume of the young voices, shouting out and calling to each other all the time working like demons with a sense of urgency and purpose. Darius leads his two crews out from the compound, a quiet word already spoken with Liam, telling him to keep an eye on the younger ones and be ready to help. That was all it needed, and the young lad is transformed with his chest puffed out and a serious look in his eye. Throughout the hot morning, they work hard. Walls are knocked through as the children get coated in brick dust and filth. 
A few cuts and bruises here and there quickly tended to by the ever-watchful Lenski and her girls. The plants forgotten for the day as everyone comes out of the units to get stuck in. Maddox works hard, moving between the crews and helping lift, carry, move and graft shoulder to shoulder with everyone else. He takes the time to comment and praise the hard-working youths. As the last section of fence is moved up and stacked at the junction, Darius returns with a long line of children carrying scaffolding poles and wooden boards. He ditches them down and sends Liam back with Riker's crew to bring the rest. All right, Maddox, what's up? He takes the bottle of water held out by the leader. Nothing, you? Nothing. They both grin at the long-standing greeting shared by them for years. That Liam, he's doing well, bruv. Good. He's up for crew chief, then. Yeah, I think so, Darius replies, trying to remember not to use so much slang now. Did you see any infected? Maddox asks. None. Not one, Darius replies with a shrug. We need to move quickly and get those fences up. We're undefended now, Maddox says, looking back down the road and straight into the compound. Where do you want me? Darius asks. Everywhere, Maddox says with a big grin, making Darius laugh at seeing his best friend so animated instead of the usual deadpan poker face. Four. The infection is everywhere, in every village, every town, every city, and every country, and it targets those that cause the most damage, knowing that in order to survive, those killers must be stopped. All across the world, the undead gather in great numbers, headed by a host body of enhanced powers and of ever-changing and evolving abilities. The infection works quickly to understand the human brain and the processes it can achieve. Telepathy has been accomplished by the infection manipulating the blood cells passed from the enhanced host into the bodies of the infected. The few remaining survivors spread across the planet are outnumbered so vastly, but still they fight back and inflict huge losses to the hosts. For every human taken, many hosts fall, and the infection knows it cannot withstand this rate of attrition. Without conscious thought, the infection cannot simply choose to disengage and withdraw. Survival means finding new hosts and preventing the loss of the ones already taken. In the south of England, past the northern edge of a vast and sprawling council estate, a lone zombie stands, staring on the motorway which forms the border of the huge urban jungle. Skin a sickly pallor, dried blood round his mouth, clothes filthy, torn, and hanging from his gaunt frame. Losses have been taken here, far too many, inflicted by young host bodies, fighting with an alarming and ferocious savagery. The zombie stands erect and with intelligence within the red bloodshot eyes. An adult male, employed as a taxi driver before he was blessedly taken into this new state of being, and for the last day he has been busy. Busy finding hosts, drawing blood and building resources, summoning every host for miles and drawing them here. Past the motorway, over the crash barrier and above the slight incline hordes of undead gather in the rolling fields. The drooling, decaying, fetid undead shuffle and groan quietly, sensing the need to stay in this place despite the urge to move and find food. The undead shuffle in from every direction, massing in great numbers. Still wearing his blood-spattered photo identity badge from his previous life, the super zombie stares into the estate, patiently waiting as more bodies shuffle into view, stumbling across the sun-baked tarmac to join the Legion. This enhanced host has learnt, as Darren did, that moving too fast during the day weakens the bodies, so it conserves that energy. The only thing it doesn't know is if it can resist the urge until nightfall, or whether he will succumb to the depraved hunger and charge earlier. 5. Maddox stands back from the junction, looking down towards the compound, now out of sight behind the high fence and gates erected across the road. Panels fixed to the sides of the houses, using the tools the boss man sourced during the first couple of days, and copying how he drilled into the ground and bolted the thick metal posts into place, 
and attaching the panels to the posts. The walls of the houses on either side form a solid line down to their garden walls, and more high fencing topped with coiled razor wire has been fixed against the walls, providing a solid unbroken line, securing the base within. Check the gates, he yells out, and watches as Darius pushes both the solid metal gates out. Wide enough to drive a lorry through, they push out to a 90 degree angle. Satisfied, Maddox shouts to close them back up. The next decision is where to put the guard tower. They can use the upstairs windows of the houses to view down the opposite street, but not the full length of the street opposite. He wants the tower outside of the gates, in the middle of the junction, but that would mean whoever was inside it could get isolated or trapped. Maybe something could be rigged up from the top of the tower to the window of the closest house, an escape route. But the gap is too big. If he moved the tower closer to the building, they would lose the view. Where are you putting it? Darius asks as Maddox walks back through the gate into the now extended compound. We'll try behind the gate first. We'll get a bit of a view of the side streets, but a full view of that one. He points to the road leading away opposite them. We'll have people in those windows too. So we got to cover the front, the sides and the back too? Darius questions with a serious look. If we're all at the front or in the units, it leaves the back open. Why not just use a crew each night, you know, make them in charge of the security for that night and they can rest the next day. I like it, Darius. Maddox nods with respect. Fucking good idea, yeah? You get that sorted then. I'm on it. Darius grins broadly at having his suggestion taken on board. Leaving Darius to oversee the scaffold tower, Maddox makes his way down the short road, admiring the greater stretch of ground they have gained, looking at the front of the houses on either side and wondering how to make best use of them. As he nears the old fence point, Lenski walks out from the end of the unit, clutching her clipboard and drinking from a bottle of water. The fence, it looked good, yes? she asks, handing him the bottle. He takes the water and takes a long plug from the top, feeling the refreshing liquid cascade down his parched throat. Yeah, we got it all fixed in. Darius just doing the tower now. They fall into step side by side, walking towards the sound of banging, shouts and clouds of dust as the kids happily smash walls down. Stepping over the fallen bricks and debris, they look through to the end. A clear line of sight through the small gardens to the high-end wall and the even higher fencing fixed against it. The youths working here, smashing up the big lumps of concrete and wall to make them easier to move, look up and smile as Maddox and Lenski walk through. We should use the houses for the crews, no? Ten houses we have gained here, the five on each side, so with eight crews is good, yes? Lenski asks, watching Maddox finish the water off. He lowers the bottle and grins apologetically. Sorry, I was thirsty. This I see... Lenski says with one raised eyebrow. You like idea? We put crews here, yes? Yeah, I think so. Maddox agrees and outlines the details of Darius's plan to keep one crew up every night and tasked with security. They stroll through to the end and then back out and up the other side. Maybe we give the crews the food for the week and they do as they want with it, Lenski suggested. No, Maddox laughed. They'll eat the best stuff the first night and sell the rest for drugs. Oh, the drugs. What do we do with them? I know what I want to do. Maddox drops his voice and Lenski notices the hard edge to his tone. I'd fucking burn the lot of them. We do this, yes? Lenski urged. Not yet. One step at a time. Remember where these kids have come from. They've grown up on this shit, so we need to tread carefully, and there'll be plenty of people out there that will still want it. For what? Why they need this drug now? Lenski demanded with a scowl. Look what's happened. The world's fucked up overnight. Maybe that shit might make it easier for them or something. The point is, there are people that will want it, so we can use it for trade. Okay. She shrugs, clearly not convinced, but willing to let the point go for now. What do you do next? He sucks in a breath and lets rip. 
get the scaffold up and work out where to put the tower, then got to look at the houses and make sure they're all the same size, otherwise it will spark the crews off if one gets something the others don't. Then we need beds and bedding, and while we're moving all the stuff from the tents, we need to check to make sure they're clean. We also got to work out a way to divide the rooms up and give everyone equal space. Now, do we give the crew chiefs their own room or not? Because these houses ain't that big, really. Okay, okay, she waves her clipboard to slow him down. I take the point. Yeah, lots to do. He cocks his head to one side, staring at the freckles on her nose. You're very busy. We both are, he nods. She nods back. See you in your room in two minutes, she asks quietly. Definitely, he replies. They walk separate directions as Lenski jogs back towards the unit and Maddox finds Darius to tell him to hold the fort. Why, where you going, bruv? Darius asks in confusion while trying to organise the scaffold tower being erected. Uh, I got something to do. Where? Inside. Maddox stares at the distracted lad trying to convey a message to stop asking. Inside? Darius asks while hefting a long pole. What are you doing inside? I need to speak to Lenski. Lenski, Darius repeats. He catches the glare from Maddox and stares back dumbly for a second before finally catching on. Oh, Lenski, he laughs with delight. Yeah, of course, bruv. You go and have that private chat and I'll stay here. Yeah, thanks. Maddox growls softly and walks off, leaving Darius smiling and shaking his head. He makes himself walk at a normal pace towards the unit, checking about him nodding and waving at the youths and girls coming and going. Once inside, he checks about, making sure he's out of sight, and starts running to his room, bursting in and finding Lenski already undressed and lying naked on his bed. I think Darius knows, Maddox says as he quickly strips off. About us, is that good? Lenski asks with a grin. Right now, I don't care. He dives onto the bed, provoking a squeal from Lenski that's quickly cut off as their mouths find one another. Furious but fun work takes place both inside his room and all across the compound as slowly a new community is forged. 6. I'm telling you, they're just little kids, the little shits we'd see running around here on their bikes, Jeff yells, wincing at the pain from his black eye and swollen nose. Jeff, we agree, the man opposite him implores. But they're tough little bastards and they got guns. Look in the bloody mirror if you don't believe what they can do. This? Jeff points at his own bruised face and moves round in a circle to take in the faces of the crowd gathered together. This was a lucky shot done by some little wanker. I would have stopped him, but he had two little bastards with shotguns stood right behind him. The two women with him yesterday raised their eyebrows knowingly. Jeff didn't have time to react. That youth moved so fast, none of them saw it coming until it was too late. Now listen. Jeff softens his tone and looks round at the survivors all brought together in the main library of the council estate. This being the least likely place the kids would go to. Surprisingly, not one survivor had seen a zombie or a youth so far today. Now come on, listen, Jeff repeats. They've taken all our food, our supplies, and for what? Well, we all got here without being eaten, a voice shouts from the back. They got rid of the dead things. Yes, well, Jeff bridles at the quick answer. Be that as it may, but we have all seen how slow those things are during the day. Any of us could have killed them off. But we didn't, the same voice shouts. They did, and I ain't seen one of them since late yesterday afternoon. But the fact is, we could have done if we wanted, but we couldn't because we were too scared of those bloody kids. Did you see what they did to old Naylor? He was a bloody idiot. That same blasted voice shouts again, irritating Jeff and making him wince more than the pain in his face. He was always getting nicked for knocking people about. Thought he was a proper hard bastard, he did. Ha, sod him. Bloody kids did a good job, if you ask me. But those bloody kids didn't know he was like that, did they? And they'd done it before and they'll do it again. Has anyone seen them out today? That same bloody voice from the back asks. Who is that? Jeff cranes his head over the tops trying to see. Bodies shuffle out of the way as a bespectacled older man comes into view, smiling round at everyone. Watcher, 
The man nods in greeting, repeating the word a few times as he stares around. So has any of you seen the kids or what? The old man asks. They were carrying some scaffolding poles from the shops earlier, someone answers. Where to? Jeff asks. Dunno, maybe that base they got. Yeah, that base, it's got all our food and our guns, that base with the big safe fences round it. What's your point, Nipper? The old man asks. My point, Jeff sighs, is that they've got everything and we've got nothing, and it ain't bloody right, they're just sodding kids. Kids, eh? The old man asks. Yes, kids, Jeff repeats, as if that proved everything. So you're complaining because the children are safe and protected with lots of food behind big fences and lots of guns. The children, that is. The small ones that... Well, yes, of course the children should be there. Jeff quickly cuts across him, fearing he was losing the point already. But why should the rest of us suffer and go without? You got the whole estate. You can come and go as you want. Take what houses you want. The old man started counting the advantages off. Well, we can't come and go as we want with those things out there. But we ain't seen those things, have we? Those kids have killed them all. Those kids you're complaining about behind those big fences with the guns. Yes, all right. Thank you for that. Jeff rubbed his face and whimpered from the pain shooting through his nose. All I'm saying is that we should all be behind the fences with the guns and the food. We should all be safe. Then we'd have the guns and could kill those things. Ah. Them kids didn't use the guns on them things. The old man pulled his glasses off and started wiping the lenses with the corner of his filthy cardigan. They did it with sticks, stones, bats, knives and their bare hands too, he added as he slid the glasses back onto his nose. But not guns. But they had all the food, Jeff argued. So they had the energy and the... the... well, the energy. You said energy already, the old man smiled graciously. And they were out by the next day, killing them before they got all the food. Have they taxed you, old man? Jeff asked with an exasperated tone. Me? The old man looked surprised. Of course they have. Damn polite they were too. I said I was happy to give my half, seeing as they got all them young mouths to feed and they was out killing the zombos and all that. Some black kid, mad sticks or something. Anyway, damn polite he was, and said if I had any grief, I just had to tell him, and he'd make sure it was sorted. He said the same to me, an older woman interjected. His lot bloody killed my neighbour, though, and in front of his wife. She ain't said a word since then. That's what he wanted, and Jeff seized on it quickly, turning to the man and shouting... So your neighbour was an innocent man just trying to feed his family and these little shits killed him in cold blood? Well, I wouldn't quite say that, the man replied, rubbing his chin. See, the bloke did go at him with one of them samurai swords, you know, the ones you get from the Sunday newspapers. Murmurs and nods rumble quietly round the room. Yeah, so he kind of did provoke him. Sounds like he was just trying to defend his property, if you ask me. And right in front of his wife, too, you said. Yeah, right in front of her it was. After they took the other two swords off her, that is. But still... The man's voice trails off, unsure of what his original point was. Right, well, I just don't think we should be living a life of servitude under a communist regime designed to disinherit us of our hard-earned possessions, Jeff said remembering some of the course he was sent on by the trade union. He looked round to a sea of blank, grimy faces and one old bespectacled man sniggering with mirth. Them's words a bit much for us stupid council house folk, I reckon, the old man smirked. Why should we get robbed in our own homes? We need food too, Jeff translated and got a few nods of encouragement now they understood what he meant. They're all drug addicts, high on crack and meth and speed. They'll be selling our babies to the highest bidder before long and forcing us into the sex trade. Jeff spun round, sensing that he might just be getting somewhere. And when this is over, when the government get control back, which they will, and when the army come rolling through here, which they will, Jeff's voice rose in volume as he moved between the nodding faces most of them unsure of why they were nodding, but happy to be nodding all the same, because they were scared and starting to get hungry, and this man was saying things in a loud voice, and he looked quite tough with those bruises. 
They're going to want to know why we didn't stand up to a bunch of kids who were probably trained by terrorist camps. Oh yes, they were probably trained by terrorist camps who want to end your way of life and make you slowly starve. Jeff spun round dramatically, seeing the startled faces watching him. Where do you think this started from, eh? We've all heard of germ warfare, haven't we? We all know about dirty bombs, don't we? That's what they're doing here. Dropping dirty bombs full of germs and turning people into flesh eaters while they steal our children and turn them into terrorists. Well, we won't stand for it. No, we won't. They are dropping bombs and germs on us and taking our children, making us into sex slaves and forcing us to take crack up our veins. But it stops now. It stops tonight. We will take our children back and give them the discipline they need. Brainwashed they are, and we need to de-brainwash them. So who will join me tonight in protecting our country and stopping those evil terrorists from injecting heroin into our baby's eyes? Every hand in the library rises, apart from one belonging to an old man with spectacles who tuts and shuffles his way through the idiotic and pumped-up crowd to stand for a few minutes in the nice warm sunlight. He quite liked the young lad called Mad Socks or whatever it was. He was very polite and had a good firm handshake. You can tell a lot about a man from the look in his eye and the hand he gives to shake. The estate was probably the safest now that it had ever been, so whoever that boss man was, well, he was doing a good job. The old man sighed and wondered why people had to go and keep changing things. It was quieter now. Well, those bloody zombo things were gone, and if it stays like this, then the estate will be a very nice place to live again. The old man looked up the street and contemplated going to that compound he'd been told about, just to warn them a little bit about some of these idiots coming to make complaints tonight. Give them a chance to get a few excuses ready, or even switch the lights off and pretend no one's home but it is far away and the sun is very hot, so thinking maybe he would prefer a bottle of beer from the crate that nice young man left him to drink, and those kids were sure to be round at some point today. He could tip them off then and save his tired old legs. So, with a sigh, the old man slowly started making his way back along the debris-littered, blood-stained, corpse-strewn street, back to his boarded-up house to wait for the pack of feral kids to come back round. Seven. Using a car battery would be hard as it would need to remain connected to the engine while it's running, otherwise it would drain too quickly. But we could use that. Nick points to the long, sleek vessel tied onto the end of the pier. I look over at the big white catamaran used for carrying passengers between the island and mainland, with one main interior level for passengers and a small outside area on the top. It looks low and fast. They have power sources running from the engine. All we'd need to do is start it up, and they've probably got a facility on board to heat water too, Nick adds, with a look of yearning in his eyes. Hot water? I ask. Yeah, for the hot water taps in the toilets. Can I have a go? Having brought me outside to show me his idea, he stands waiting, itching to be given the nod to go and play on the big ship. Do you think you could drive it? I ask him. Drive it? He replies, puzzled. What for? Going back in? In that? Yeah, why not? Bloody hell, yeah, definitely! Nick laughs at the idea, nudging Tom and nodding towards it. We'll come on with you and make sure it's clear, then leave you to it. I'll let the others know while you figure out a way of getting onto it. Walking away, I leave Nick and Tom talking excitedly about getting to drive the ship. The end of the pier is huge. A vast open car park shaped like a hammer on the end of the long, thin approach road. Blowers and Cookie have sat on the reverse side, happily fishing away while maintaining a constant view of the land and the pier. The catamaran is on the outside edge. The only problem is that these waters are tidal, which is why the pier was built in the first place. Even this far out from the shore, the tide still comes in and out, which means it was tied securely to the pier when the tide was in, and then left there while the end of the world began. When the tide went out, the boat sank and ripped out all the ropes and mooring posts from the vast weight slowly sinking. All but one rope must have snapped or torn free, leaving just one tied to the front. With the motion of the tide, the ship has swung out and is facing the pier. Later, when the direction of the tide changes, the boat will come back and nudge against the structure. 
something it's already done a few times, judging by the dents alongside one side and the thick black scuff marks on the front. Luckily, the weather has been exceptionally mild, without high winds, otherwise I've no doubt it would now be floating away to France or have smashed the pier up. Walking back into the café, I see Lani bending over in the large storeroom behind the counter, going through the shelves and sorting food out. Again, and fortunately for us, the café serves a mostly transient customer, and with ferries coming and going every half hour during the summer, it meant the waiting time was very limited, which also meant the café served mainly pre-packaged snack food. Good for us, as most of it was in the cooler storeroom, and either still in date or just gone. Mostly muffins, cakes, biscuits and the like, and boxes of crisps and chocolate bars. But it will have to do for now. She catches me walking past and smiles sweetly, which I return without blushing for once. At the back, Clarence sits dozing in a chair while Dave is seated off to one side, his knives all laid out on the table and a sharpening stone in his hand, running back and forth along the already lethal blade. We're going to try and board that big ship tied up. Nick thinks it will have power and maybe hot water if he can get it going, I explain. Blowers and Cookie both twist round to listen, and Clarence holds his hands over his eyes to shield them from the sun while squinting up at me. Hasn't it swung out? Clarence asks. Yeah, we need to figure a way of getting on board and clearing it. As soon as the words are said, they're up on their feet. The rods get reeled in and put to one side as they gather axes and knives up. You caught anything yet? I ask the lads. We got a crab, but it was as ugly as blowers with massive pincers, so we put it back, Cookie replies. Lani joins us seeing the weapons being taken up, and I quickly relay the plan while she grabs her meat cleaver. Outside, we walk to the outer edge and stand there staring at the vessel gently bobbing a few metres away. I turn round and check our position, making sure we can still see the pier stretching out behind us down to the shore. Well, unless Clarence can pull it back in, I reckon the easiest way is going to be along that rope. I nod at the thick, taut rope stretched between the pier and the vessel. There's no movement on board. Clarence stares out with his eyes shielded from the sun again. Should be safe enough to get a couple on board and check it through. I'll do it, Lani says, eyeing the rope. Hang on. Clarence walks over to the rope secured to the mooring post and looks down at the length wrapped round the thick post. There's enough rope left to pull it back in. Come on. He starts unwinding the rope from the post and feeds it out behind him as we run up and each take a double-handed grip. Ready? Clarence releases the last coil from the post and immediately the ship starts pulling us towards the edge. The big man runs round to the back, grasping the rope and taking an anchor position as we start straining to pull it back in. Shit! I grunt as the receding tide pulls the boat away from the shore. The sheer weight of it outmatches even our combined pulling strength. We dig in, cursing and grunting, but getting pulled gently towards the edge of the pier. You didn't think that one through, Clarence! I shout through gritted teeth. Sorry, boss! He yells from the back. The ship drifts away, and we cling onto the rope, refusing to give in hoping we can prevent the motion and start dragging it back in. The edge looms closer and closer with Lani at the front, followed by Dave and the rest of us stretched out in a line. Clarence curses loudly as he slips on a patch of oil. Without his strength, we're suddenly yanked forward. With a yelp, Lani sails over the edge of the pier, followed by a yelling Dave. As they release their grip, the boat gains more momentum and anyone left holding the rope is jerked towards the edge. Every one of us sailing over and into the blue waters with yells and shouts. Plunging in, and luckily the tide is still quite high so the drop isn't too bad, I push back up to the surface, spitting water from my mouth. A braying donkey sounds from somewhere and I turn round to look up at Clarence bent double and clutching his stomach as he laughs uncontrollably at the sight of the rest of us all bobbing in the water. I want hot water, Lani yells and swims after the rope. Reacting quickly, I swim after her with Nick right behind me. We each gain a length of rope between our hands and start pulling ourselves hand over hand through the water, with Lani in front moving swiftly along the rope. 
She climbs nimbly clear of the water and scales the thick rope, using her feet against the side of the vessel, and within a few seconds she reaches the top and pulls herself onto the front of the ship. I go next, gritting my teeth, I start lifting myself out of the water. If this had been two weeks ago, I don't think I would have stood much of a chance. But now with most of the fat burnt from my body and after constantly swinging the heavy axe, I surprise myself with my strength and grin stupidly as I clamber up the side, copying Lani and using my feet to help me up. Reaching the top, I grab the side and lever myself in, falling down into a wet puddle. Coughing and spluttering, I go to stand up and watch as Nick's grinning face reaches the lip. Lani and I help him over until we're stood there, dripping and smiling like idiots. Bloody hope you can drive this thing. I nod towards the retreating pier and lift my arms high above my head to wave, showing the others that we made it. Have either of you got a weapon? They both shake their heads after patting sodden pockets down. Don't worry, I'll protect you both. Lani smiles and moves off down the side. Nick and I shrug and walk along the narrow gangway towards the big sliding door. Oh dear. Lani calls back after peering in through the glass. Joining her, we peer through the darkened glass at the group of undead, all stood swaying in the middle of the floor. Well, it's day, so they're slow, Nick muses, his breath misting the glass in front of his mouth. Yeah, but hand to hand, I answer. Only takes a bite, mate. Open the door and lure them outside, Lani suggests. Okay, grab those fire extinguishers as soon as we get in. Ready? They both nod, and I pull the door back. We rush into the cool interior and quickly yank the heavy metal cylinders free from their fixings. The main level is the width of the vessel and fitted with rows of seats with two wide aisles running down either side. We grab at the fire extinguishers and pull the covers off. I get a big, heavy, red, water-filled one, while the others get smaller, chemical-filled extinguishers. The undead react and slowly shuffle round, giving groans as they see their lunch waiting for them. Fuck, is that the captain? Nick asks at the sight of the uniformed zombie with a dark blue suit with golden stripes on the cuffs and wearing a flat cap on the back of his head. Guess so, I reply quietly as we back away towards the open door. I pull the plastic strip from my handle and aim the hose at the approaching horde. A jet of water sprays out as I squeeze the handle, soaking the zombies' faces and having no effect other than washing some of the dried blood away. Let me try, Nick says and pulls the strip out. He steps in and squirts foam into them from a few feet away, thick, creamy foam that covers their faces. They groan and moan at the abuse, but other than that, they keep coming. My turn. Lani darts in and opens up with her chemical powder extinguisher. The noise is really loud and makes Nick and I jump. She holds the aim on one poor sod, who gets blasted back by the high-powered jet of powder. He staggers into the others as the powder gets into his mouth. He staggers back and tries shuffling again, but then starts coughing and spluttering as he chokes on the powder in his throat. We watch in fascinated horror as the thing shuffles and flaps his arms about, whacking the others and knocking the captain's hat off. Eventually, he falls down and stays writhing on the ground. Get another one, Nick urges. Lani obliges by darting forward and squeezing the handle. A thick jet flies out, then ends abruptly. Shit, she pumps the handle, then steps in and swings the solid metal tube into the side of the zombie's head, smashing it down onto the ground as she retreats back to the door. We slowly move backwards and out onto the side of the ship. The zombies follow with their awkward shuffle, reaching the threshold and getting bunched up as they all try and turn onto the narrow walkway running down the side. Two of them simply fall off the side, unable to navigate the ground and stepping out into thin air. Two left who amazingly keep on the narrow walkway, shuffling and swaying their way along. I edge forward and jab the end of the tube into the face of the closest one. He reels back a step and teeters off the edge before recovering and coming forward again. I step in and jab out harder, forcing him to knock the other one off the side and down into the water. With a smashed-in nose, he again recovers and starts shuffling towards us. Hang on! Nick shouts and leans over me to fire his thick foam into its face and covering the eyes. Blinded, the zombie groans loudly and keeps coming as I step in and swing my heavy water-filled tube in a massive uppercut. 
The impact reels the thing backwards onto its arse. It flails about for a couple of seconds before gently sliding off the edge and splashing into the water. He's extinguished, Nick says. Ha, <laughs> nice one, mate, I reply. After throwing the bodies out the side door and into the sea, we quickly squelch down the aisles and clear the big room within a couple of minutes. A door set into a large central column leads to a steep, narrow staircase. Going first, I climb up and reach the bridge. Expecting a bank of modern equipment, I'm surprised at how minimalist the bridge is. Just a central desk area with a few monitors, but lots of switches, dials and levers. Nick follows me and immediately goes to the unit. His actions are the same as at Tower Bridge, and he stares at the many instruments, running his fingers over them and murmuring to himself quietly. There'll be an engine room downstairs, Mr Howie. Could you clear that while I figure this out? OK, mate. I nod to Lani. We go back down the stairs and start searching round for a way into the bottom of the boat. More doors at the rear lead out onto a small platform, with metal stairs leading up onto the top outside deck. A solid metal door set into the rear of the vessel painted white and with a thick metal bar handle locking it in place. I pull the lever back. The door opens on soundless hinges, presenting a wide staircase going down. We step over the high ledge and descend into the engine room. Gaining the bottom, we peer down the dark length of the ship, the only light coming from the open door at the top of the stairs. Standing still and breathing quietly, we listen for any other noise. Nothing, just the creak of the vessel. Stay here, I whisper to Lani. She nods once and I move off down into the gloom, my eyes adjusting as I gradually make my way down. A large central engine block takes up most of the room, shiny with things poking out and tubes, wires and leads feeding off it. Wide metal tubing snakes round the side of the ceiling and the floor is beveled stainless steel, offering good grip. I keep my steps slow and steady, breathing gently and holding the fire extinguisher up high, ready to slam down onto any zombie faces that lunge in. Nooks and crannies everywhere, deep recesses hidden in shadows. Slowly I make my way down towards the rear, or it would be the front. Yes, it's the front of the ship I'm heading towards, but the back of the engine room. Bloody military and bloody ships with different bloody words for everything. We never had this problem at Tesco, you know. A loud clunk startles me from my internal moaning, followed by lights blinking on and the sound of things humming, whirring and other machine noises. I tense up, expecting there to be someone stood there with a hand on the light switch while leaning back in a big black chair and stroking a white cat. Ah, Mr Howie, we've been expecting you. Instead, there's just an empty room. Well, it's empty of people, or undead anyway, but filled with machines and the giant engine in the middle. An old-fashioned phone fixed to the wall chirps loudly. A bright red light fixed to the top flashes brightly. Lani steps in with a puzzled smile and picks the phone up. Hello, this is the engine room, she says with a very polite tone and listens for a few seconds. Please hold, Captain, while I pass that message on to the chief engineer. It's Nick, she shouts to me. He's got an override system up there and said there should be a button or switch down here that you can use that will give him full control from the bridge. Hang on, any idea what it looks like? I stare around at the confusing mass of instruments and dials. He said it's probably either red or green colour, so that it's easy to spot. His words, not mine. She adds with a smile when I pass an eyebrow raised look. I move over to a desk and start examining the display. Captain, I don't have the power. Lani speaks loudly into the handset with a mock Scottish accent, making me laugh. Got it, I shout over, switching the green button marked simply with Control, Engine Bridge. I select the bridge and stand back, feeling rather pleased with myself. Mr Howie said he found it. Uh-huh. Yep, OK, Captain. She replaces the handset. He said he'll figure it out from here. You know, I can't believe we just bloody did that, I remark. Separating the group and putting ourselves in danger like that. No weapons, not really sure if we can get the thing going or not. That was a bad shout. We reacted with instinct, Howie. It's a good prize and worth a little risk. And if it didn't work, then the others would figure out a way of getting to us. Yeah, but what if something had happened while we were separated? Howie, you can't control everything and they know what they're doing. 
No, I didn't mean they wouldn't be able to function without us. Bloody hell, Dave and Clarence could do the work of 20 normal men. I mean just being split up. I don't like it. With a loud clunk, the engine splutters into life. A low grumble that slowly builds with a whine into a loud roaring that makes the floor vibrate. We both smile huge grins as the engine settles back down to a low, steady rumble. There you go, she smiles, as I walk back towards her in the stairs. The engine increases in pitch as the boat starts moving. Down here with no windows, we can't tell how fast or what direction. As I get closer to Lani... The boat lurches round as Nick steers it over, sending me flying into Lani stood only a few feet away. We collide and grab out to steady ourselves, coming to rest face to face with Lani pressed up against the wall, our bodies touching, faces just inches apart. I can feel the warmth of her body radiating through her wet clothes. She stares up at me, her dark eyes and golden skin, beautiful lips parting slightly. The temptation to lean in and kiss her overwhelms me. My head drops as she watches me closely, her eyes close and she moves forward a fraction. My heart is pounding more than in any battle so far. Adrenaline surges through me and I can feel the blood roaring past my ears. It's warm here, the noise of the engine blocking all other sounds out. Her body's so close, I can feel her breath on my skin. Soft, warm, inviting. The boat spins round in another harsh turn, causing us to break apart, and I stagger away, trying to maintain my feet. The spell is broken, and I stand still for a second, breathing heavily. She remains wedged into the same position, her feet braced, preventing her from getting rolled about. A look of disappointment briefly flashes across her features, instantly replaced as she opens her eyes and smiles at me. We better go up! I have to shout over the engine to make myself heard. She hesitates for a second before pushing herself off the wall and nodding back to me. Leading the way, we go back up the stairs and into the passenger lounge. Having a view of the landscape now, and I can see the waters are gently rolling by as Nick brings the power down to a more steady pace. Taking care in case Nick tries another hairpin turn, we reach the narrow staircase and climb onto the bridge. Nick is at the central desk, moving his gaze between the dials in front of him and the view outside. Well done, mate. The engines are now a distant thrum, and we can speak at nearly normal volume. It's bloody complicated. He turns round, grinning. They've got side thrusters and things. I reckon it's so they can push the ship into the side of the pier, or maybe keep the thruster things on and hold it there while people are getting on and off. There's alarms flashing at me too, so I don't think I've gone through the right sequence to get the thing going, but... His voice trails off as he looks down at a flashing red light. Shrugging, he continues... Well, at least we've got it running. Sorry about the hard turns, but it's more sensitive than it looks. No problem, I reply, finding a pair of binoculars hanging from a strap. I lift them up, and I turn round to view the end of the approaching pier. The figures are clear through the magnified lenses, especially the size difference between Clarence and Dave. Getting it alongside is going to be hard, Mr Howie, Nick says quickly. I can line it up, but I don't know enough to keep it still. Have a go, mate. What's the fuel like? Nearly full. I reckon they would have filled it up overnight, ready for the weekend. That's lucky then. Lucky day so far. Touch wood, it stays that way. I tap the side of my head. If we get tied up, we can get everyone on board. Take whatever we need from here and anchor up in the sea. It's got to be the safest place. I'll have a go, sir. His voice sounds focused. His face a picture of concentration as he navigates the multi-million pound ship towards the ancient, solid wooden structure. Lani leans by an open, sliding window, the wind blowing her hair and drying her wet clothes. Her eyes are closed with a content, serene look, and I kick myself for not taking the chance to kiss her. Bloody fumbling idiot. Shaking my head, I turn back to the now fast-approaching pier. They always go off to the side and turn in so they can drive alongside it, Lani says in her strong voice. Which side? Nick asks. To the right. I think it's deeper there. OK, he replies quietly and gently steers the ship away from the pier. The ship goes past the end and Nick starts the turn, bringing the front sweeping round in a long arc. Eventually, the vessel is lined up facing the end of the pier. Nick powers forward gently, sweat dripping from his forehead as his eyes flick between the pier and the front of the ship. Using the binoculars, I watch Clarence striding towards the end nearest us, 
He watches the approach, then quickly lifts his arm, motioning to pull away. Move to the left, mate, I relay to Nick. At the dead slow speed, the ship takes a few seconds before the end swings out. Clarence watches a few seconds, then motions to pull back in. I relay the instructions as Lani watches from the side window. Poor Nick does his best, making minor adjustments before smashing the side of the ship into the end of the pier with a hard jolt. Sorry, he yells with a look of horror. Forget it, mate. It's not our boat. I shrug as he lines up and drags the side of the ship along the hard edge of the pier. Loud screeches of metal against wood rip through the air. The rest of the group come into view as I stride over to the window and lean out. Get everything ready and get on. We'll stay on this for a bit. They nod back and quickly move off towards the buildings. Lani and I descend down to the passenger level and out through the still open sliding passenger door. Nick, I shout out. Can you hear me? Yes. His voice drifts out of the open window on the bridge. Go, a bit more forwards, keep going, more, almost. Yes, that's it, hold it there. The pier's access point, a lower level accessed by steps leading down and allowing vessels to berth with the lower tide, draws level as Nick lines it up perfectly, then goes gently sliding past as we overshoot. Too far, needs to go back. Trying, Nick's voice sails from the window. The engine changes in pitch as Nick reverses the boat. Too much power, and we slam back into the side of the pier. Use those side thruster things, Lani shouts up. I'm trying, Nick's harassed voice comes from the window. I'll go up, Howie, Lani says before darting back in and jogging over to the staircase. I wait patiently for a few seconds before I hear their muted voices drifting down. The engine changes in pitch again as the vessel suddenly surges sideways and slams into the pier once more with a loud bang. Don't you like this pier, Nick? Cookie shouts out as he jogs back, carrying several of our kit bags, the shotgun butts all sticking out. Piss off, Cookie! Nick retorts loudly. Cookie smirks before carefully dropping down the steps. A fluctuating gap between the vessel and the pier forms between Cookie and I. Chuck them over, mate, I say. Cookie drops them down and starts launching them into the open passenger doorway. As he leaves, I move back in and stack them up to one side. Tom and Blowers arrive next. More bags and also carrying boxes of muffins, crisps and cases of water bottles. Everything gets chucked over as they run back and forth, effectively stripping the cafe of anything usable. Clarence must be directing them, getting them to take everything that might be of use. Fishing rods, the heavy winter coats we slept on, a cardboard box full of black handheld radios with stubby aerials. Then Tom and Blowers appear carrying the heavy coffee machine between them, the lead dangling from Tom's teeth. Bloody hell, I exclaim. Good idea though, I add with a nod. They perch dangerously on the edge, trying to work out how to pass it over. Put it down and one of you jump in. I can see them both falling down the gap and getting crushed by the ship, and as much as we all like coffee, I judge that maybe losing two of our group is a price too much for it. They lower the coffee machine as Clarence appears carrying armfuls of axes, Dave just behind him. They work themselves out with Clarence taking the coffee machine, while Blowers takes a running jump and launches himself into the ship. Tom goes next, leaving Clarence stood there, holding the shiny coffee maker. Nick! Push it in again as gently as you can, I shout up. Lani's head appears through the window. Looking down, she sees the stupid task we're attempting and nods down to us. A couple of seconds later, she shouts, Hang on, as the ship pushes against the side of the pier. As the vessel connects, I shout, Now! And Clarence steps forward holding the coffee machine out as Blowers and Tom take it from him. Between us, we manage to grapple the machine on board and give a cheer when we get inside, the small victory bringing a sense of accomplishment. Within a couple of minutes, we're all loaded, our small group reunited. The kit gets left on the floor as we all go up onto the bridge, the lads grouping around Nick and Lani. Clarence strides up to the grinning lad and pats him heavily on the shoulder, almost sending him sprawling into the desk. Brilliant, Nick. He rumbles with a grin, and I can see Nick is pretty much floating off the ground with the compliment. Lani worked out the side thruster things, he replies. Clarence and the others turn to the woman and restart the compliments while she smiles graciously.
Turning round, I see Dave looking as expressionless as Lani, but something in his eyes tells me he's not happy. Sorry, Dave, we shouldn't have gone after it like that, I say quietly. We split the group, Mr Howie, Dave answers with a straight look. My stomach drops at the implication and disappointment clearly evident to me in his otherwise unchanged tone. It was instinct, Dave. We saw the rope and went for it. I know what you're saying, and I thought the same just after we got on board. He stays looking at me silently. Lesson learnt, I add in a quiet voice. It's good, though, he adds thoughtfully, and safer than being on land. I thought you didn't like boats. I don't. But this is all right. It's safer for the group and keeps us together, so yes, it's all right. OK, Dave, point taken. There is one problem, Mr Howie. What? We're on the water, which is flat, and we're on a big white boat that everyone for miles will be able to see moving. So it's a good thing having this boat, but also a bad thing having this boat? Yes, he answers. Good and bad with everything, Mr Howie. Dave, if you had a full cup and drank half of the contents, how would you refer to the remaining contents of the cup? It depends. On what? What the contents were. For instance, if it's water, then I would refer to the content as water. If it was soup, then I would... No, I mean, not the actual content, as in the substance. OK, so you have a cup of water and you drink half of the water. How would you refer to the water still in the cup? I would say it was the water in the cup. OK, no, I mean, like, you've had half of the water, so... He stares back at me, hardly moving. I drink the rest not knowing when the next drink is coming. Yeah, Good idea, but how would you say the cup is left? Empty. I finished it. No, b before you drank it. Full. So when you've had half of it, soon to be empty because I know I'll drink it? Aha, but it was full. Yes, it was, but I drank it. So the cup's empty? After I drunk it, but it was full before. Right, so at the point of it being half filled, would you say half full? Yes, or half empty? Yes. Which one? It's both. It can't be both. It is both. If you had to choose one, which would it be? Neither. I'd drink it. If you couldn't drink it. Why can't I drink it? Uh, it's poisoned. Stupid thing to say. I drank poisoned water. Why would I do that? You didn't know it was poisoned. Who poisoned it? It, it doesn't matter. Look, you just can't drink it, OK? You've had half, and it's not poisoned, but you just cannot drink the other half. OK. So what would you call it? Useless. Useless? I can't drink it. It's useless. Shall we get that coffee machine plugged in? OK, Mr Howie. Nick and the lads piss about on the bridge, laughing at each other, taking turns to drive the boat. The rest of us try and sort through the kit loaded on board and find a plug socket for the coffee machine. I say try because the lads' hard turns as they egg each other on send us flying about all over the place until Dave, already looking very unhappy at being on the boat, opens the door to the bridge and says something loud enough for them to hear. Whatever it was, it was effective, as the boat immediately settled down to a more relaxed pace and in a straight line. Well done, Dave, Clarence rumbles appreciatively. The image of Lani pressed so close to my body in the engine room keeps flashing through my mind, her beautiful face staring up at me, her eyes closing gently as she waited for the kiss that never happened, and then the fleeting look of disappointment flashing across. Shit, this is the end of the world. I should be grabbing her hand now and pulling her to one side so I can snog her face off, so we can fall to a heap on the floor. You okay, Mr Howie? You're staring at my hand. Lani interrupts my thoughts, bringing me back to earth with a jump. Hey, What? Uh, yeah, I was miles away, I reply. You getting it on, or what? Clarence asks from a few feet away. What? I feel a mild sense of panic rising in my voice. The coffee machine. Did you get it on? Yes, it's on. I blurt back quickly as he gives me a strange stare, and Lani laughs softly. Your face, she whispers from the side of her mouth. This is your fault, I reply with an accusing stare. My fault? Why, because you were staring at my hand? I wasn't thinking about your hand. Oh, what then? Damn it, why does she have to ask that? Nothing, I shrug, busying myself with the machine and trying to figure out how it works. A row of buttons on the top plinth, small lights underneath them, and images of small cups. Big cups. Two cups. Need some help? Lani asks and steps in close. 
Her small but deadly hand lifts as she runs her slender fingers along the buttons. We need this one. She points to a button marked with a picture of two cups. She smiles and leans past me to take two mugs from a box, her face tantalisingly close to mine again. Next, she pulls a bag of coffee beans and shoves a load into a glass tube at the top of the machine, pressing a button, and the coffee is ground and pushed into a huge metal spoon, more like a mini shovel. How do you know how to do this? I ask, mesmerised as I watch her deftly work the controls. We had one in a place I worked, she replies. I miss what she does next, but suddenly the two mugs are beneath two spouts, pouring the hot, thick liquid into the bowls. We need milk, really? Can you start opening those portions and pour them into here? She passes me a metal jug. My fingers fumble for the plastic lip of the small UHT milk portion. I get it open and pour the meagre contents into the jug. She stares at me, grabs one and rips the top off quickly, pouring the contents in. I take another one and match her pace. She does another and we rip through them, taking our frustrations out on the defenceless plastic pots, which get mercilessly tossed onto the floor, discarded and unwanted. The white milk gets poured in. More follows as more pots fall from our hands like glistening brass shells from the GPMG. Eyes narrow and widen, mouths twitch as the portions are abused, penetrated and thrown away. The jug slowly fills and our hands work quickly. My God, she is beautiful. Soft lips that part to show white teeth, pink tongue darting out to moisten them. High cheekbones, the angle of her eyes, silken black raven hair cascading down her shoulders. Milk spurts onto her thumb as she presses too hard on the flimsy lid. The white liquid rolls down her digit as she raises it to her lips and quickly licks the dairy juice away. The jug gets filled, our feet covered in the wasted pots. She takes the jug and shoves the solid shaft of a metal pipe into the liquid, turning a knob and something hisses loudly. The milk steams and froths. She watches me watching her. Bubbles form and blow on the surface as the shaft steams and rapidly heats the milk. She dials the knob back down and takes the two mugs already filled with the thick espresso coffee. Slowly, she upends the milk pot and pours the frothed liquid into the mugs. Gently spooning the creamy liquid out, she fills the mugs and pushes them slightly towards me. Dave, Clarence, coffee, I call out. The lads appear and reach over, gently removing the cups from between Lani and me. I'll go and see if the boys want a coffee, she says, before moving off and disappearing through the door to the bridge. Sighing and breathing out, I turn round and rub the stress from my forehead. Stretching and rolling my shoulders, too. Opening my eyes, I see Clarence and Dave both stood a few feet away, holding frothed cups of coffee and watching me with interest. The mug looks ridiculous in Clarence's huge paw. What? I ask as they both stare without speaking. Nothing, boss. Clarence smiles and sips at his coffee. Very nice, he murmurs. Yeah, she is. I sigh and hold my hands up, exasperated. Really bloody nice and I'm a bumbling bloody fool. I meant the coffee, Clarence says. Oh. And she stood behind you. Oh. We'll be outside. Come on, Dave, let's have a look at the engine room. I turn round slowly, a look of extreme discomfort on my face as I see Lani stood there, expressionless and staring. I... Uh, stuttering, I take a breath and get myself in order. You got it going, then? Can I have a go? Nick bursts out from the door and starts examining the machine, running his not-so-slender fingers over the buttons and murmuring to himself quietly. Is it working, then? Cookie comes through next, followed by Tom as they gather round the machine. You'll need these opened and poured in here. I show them the boxes of milk portions and the metal jug. The frustration eases as we stand round laughing and joking as the milk portions are ripped open. The lads chucking them at each other as Clarence and Dave come back inside, the big man giving me an apologetic shrug as he watches the lads messing about. I smile back to show no hard feelings. Coffee is made for everyone. Proper coffee, with steamed milk and sugar, and the strong espresso fires us all up as the laughs get louder. Gathering on the bridge, we open the two side doors and let the warm air flow in. I stroll outside and sit on the public benches, enjoying a proper coffee and a smoke in a warm, beautiful, relaxed setting. The boxes of muffins, cakes and breadsticks get passed around. We sit there, munching in the middle of the sea and watching the blue waters surrounding us. So what's our situation? I ask everyone. 
We're almost out of shotgun shells, Dave replies. No pistol rounds left, just axes and knives. So if that had carried on last night, we could have been in the shit, Blower says. But it didn't, Clarence replies. Don't think like that. It'll mess your head up. I know we're all super hard zombie killers now, but we ain't going to last long without proper guns and bullets, Cookie adds, his point serious for once. The shotguns are good in a tight spot, Blowers continues. We need those assault rifles, really. We'll have to go for another base then, I guess, I say, looking at Dave and Clarence. We could try and load up before we get back to the fort. That'll give Chris a nice surprise. It certainly would, but I don't know any army bases anywhere around here. Clarence says. Don't need army bases, Dave cuts in. This is Navy territory. We go for them. A Navy base, I ask. Seems obvious. Do you know any? How about Navy ships, Lani asks. Like that one. She points towards Portsmouth Harbour in the distance. The bulk of a light blue, greyish coloured Navy ship anchored in amongst the backdrop of cluttered vessels and buildings. Aye, aye, blowers, you know some Navy lads. Can't you wave a signal flag or something? Cookie jokes to a splutter of laughing from Tom. Great, another person that finds his jokes funny. Blowers, too busy with a mouthful of muffin to reply, simply sticks two fingers up and smiles as crumbs spill from his mouth. Tom giggles, Cookie smirks knowingly, and Blowers coughs with laughter, showering everyone with bits of damp muffin. You dirty bastard! Nick jumps up, brushing his clothes off as the rest of us giggle from the sight of blowers trying desperately not to laugh at Cookie. Do Navy ships have assault rifles on them? I ask when everyone has settled down. Or is that a really stupid question? Yes, they do, and... Dave stares at me with a wicked pause. No, it's not. Another joke from the silent killer. Things are certainly looking up, but that just makes me look round in a state of rising panic. Nothing bad has happened for the last hour. No zombies, the ship hasn't sunk, and no sign of pirates swinging cutlasses at us. Something bad always happens, and generally it's every bloody half an hour. They have detachments of marines on board, Blowers explains. Nearly all ships have them, or at least an onboard armoury so they can do vessel boarding and things, repel attacks at close quarters, he continues. What about the GPMG? Do they have them too? Cookie asks. Sort of, Blowers nods. They have fixed guns and things on the ship. We can have a look and see what ammunition they got in the armoury. Plan then, I smile. We go for that Navy ship and see what we can find. Unless they blow us up on the way in or something. Then we load up and get round to the fort with our shiny new boat. Yeah, because our plans always work out so straightforward, Nick mutters, voicing the thoughts nearly all of us are having. Uh, who's driving the boat? Clarence suddenly asks, looking round at everyone gathered in one place. Cookie, you said you were doing it, Blowers says quickly. Piss off, Cookie shouts back. I never did, it's your turn. Someone drive the bloody thing, I shout over them, and get two sorry expressions and two sorry Mr Howies as they push and shove each other into the bridge. Nick, do you want to do it, mate? You've had the most practice. On it. Nick stuffs another blueberry muffin in his mouth and heads into the bridge. 8. It's good, very good. Maddox nods in satisfaction from the top of the now erected guard tower, with a clear view down the street opposite and a decent view down the roads running off to the left and right. Darius has fastened thick planks of wood along the northern side, giving cover to anyone climbing up and down. More thick high planks on the top level, giving waist-high cover. We need a spotlight up here. Maddox says to his friend. I'll sort it, Darius agrees. We can use some of the solar panels from the grows and rig something up, or a generator for now. What are we doing with the houses then? We'll use them as crew houses, let each crew have one, but we've got to check them all first, make sure they're the same. Yeah, right, Darius interrupted. Don't give any of them something the others ain't got. It'll kick off, bruv. Fact, Maddox nods. I don't like the idea of crews being in the two end houses. These ones closest to the junction. The top windows will be used for spotters anyway, so we'll stick with the other houses. Eight of them. Eight crews. Figures just right. What about us? Darius asks. We use the units. Me, you, Lenski and the girls. What about Sierra? She gets a house with her crew. 
Down to you, innit? If you want private time, you figure it out. Fair one, Darius smiles, already looking forward to some secret nighttime sneaking about in the dark for a fumble with his girlfriend. Get the crews gathered by the pit. We'll get the chiefs and the girls to go through their bedding while we check the houses and make sure they're ready. You gonna get them in tonight? Darius asks with surprise. Yeah, why not? Liam looks about ready to take on your crew, so we just need one more chief for Rikers. Put Mohammed on Rikers' crew, Darius advises. He'll get them sorted out, and we'll get Mohammed to choose one from his crew to step up. Liam will be fine with my crew. They're pretty good already. Good idea. Maddox looks with gratitude at Darius for his quick thinking. Right, you get the crews together, and we'll give them the good news. Darius climbs down, leaving Maddox alone and staring out over the gates. Just in one morning and a few hours of the afternoon, he's drastically changed the compound. Extended it, made a bigger space, and changed the mindset of a few youths. He knew that although the youths had lived hard lives full of violence and excess, they were also young enough to adapt, and maybe within a little while he could show them a better way. The survivors out there needed to know the compound was off-limits, simply because the children needed a safe place, and they were ready and willing to do what it took to make it safe. But maybe they could reach an agreement, one less deadly to the survivors, something that meant they could live side by side. That would take time. But Maddox knows the one thing they do have plenty of is time. He climbs down the tower and makes his way slowly to the back of the compound. Walking steadily down the street, he thinks it needs a name, something personal to them all. With a smile, he thinks of the perfect name instantly. Rounding the end of the unit, he walks towards the pit, rolling his eyes at the filth-encrusted youths, grimy from brick dust and grease, faces blackened, hands covered in dirt. But they smile and joke with each other, Instead of looking pale and sickly, the youths looked flushed with red cheeks, dressed in t-shirts and vests, hoodies off. They look like children, Maddox muses as he takes his place by the log. Good work today, he starts off quickly. We got loads done and made ourselves our own street. I was thinking about a name for it. He looks round, watching them looking at him expectantly. Zayden Street, smiles and nods all round, a few eyes fill with tears. We got ten houses in Zayden Street, five on each side. The last two next to the junction will be used by guards and for storage. The others will be crew houses, one house for each crew. Cheers erupted from the youths. Rumour had spread that this would be the plan, and the chiefs had been asked continually all day, and had to admit they didn't know either. One house each, but we got to sort them out before you get into them. A few things first. Maddox waves his hands up and down, appealing for quiet. The youths respond with a few comments from chiefs and older kids. Liam, you are now crew chief for Darius's crew. More cheers as Liam's face splits in half from the huge grin running ear to ear. Youths surround him, patting him on the back. Maddox and Darius share a quick nod, knowing a good decision has been made. Mohammed, you're going to take Riker's old crew on, and we need you to choose someone to step up for crew chief. Have a think, bruv. Maddox watches the serious lad nod back, knowing he'll understand the need for Riker's crew to be under good leadership for a while. Darius, Linsky and me will be in the units, so we get a bit of space from you lot. A few laughs. And maybe Sierra will be popping over once in a while, so Sierra, make sure you choose a good deputy for when you're sneaking about to see Darius. More laughs. Crew chiefs, I want the bedding checked for everyone. Nothing dirty or smelly is going in those houses and they get cleaned before they get used. We still got a lot to do. Get your tents organised and let Lenski and the girls know if you need clean bedding. We'll be checking the houses to see what they need. Xboxes and weed! A youth shouts out to an outbreak of giggling. Xbox, maybe. Weed, not yet. Maddox answers quickly, letting the firm tones of authority into his voice. Darius, Maddox nods at the older lad standing nearby. Yeah, from tonight, one crew will be in charge of security. The compound is too big for a few to be used now. One crew will stay up and do the guarding. The tower, some in the bedrooms of the end houses and patrols in the base too. That crew will be given the next morning off to sleep. Questions, Maddox shouts out. Do we have to use the houses? I like the tents, 
a voice calls out. We'll see, Maddox replies, using the universal get-out reply relied on by millions of teachers, parents and guardians since time began. The afternoon stretches on as Maddox, Darius and Lenski move from house to house, working out how many beds they will need, what rooms should be used as bedrooms, if the chiefs should have their own rooms, bedding, pillows, lights, weapons, power supply, toilet, toilet rolls, clean water, wipes. Lenski scribbles furiously on her clipboard as the lads discuss the options and work out solutions. Crew chiefs sort through sleeping bags and blankets, helped by the girls who now have the confidence to come out of the units, seeing the children as children for the first time, and not hardened gangsters swaggering about smoking drugs and showing off with weapons. As the crew chiefs report back to Maddox, he orders them to take the bricks and debris from the walls of the knocked-through back gardens and to make fallback positions where the old fence used to be. Remembering old movies where they would have piles of sandbags and a few soldiers crouched behind, firing madly into the approaching enemy, the chiefs round youths up and start the hard work of dragging the heavy bricks over to the compound. I was thinking, Maddox says quietly to Lenski, about the idea of using the school playing fields to plant stuff. We could speak to the survivors on the estate and get them to help, so it belongs to all of us, not just the compound. It's good. Lenski agrees quickly. It will show them we try to help and not kill them. It's good, yes? There be other places to use, too. I think they move to the houses near here soon. Why? Maddox asks. In old days, the king lived in the castle, no? The people, they live in the houses near the castle, so the king and his knights come to rescue them if the bad things happen. It's safer to be closer. They move here soon. Shit, Maddox sighed. This stuff is complicated. We should get a patrol out, Darius interrupted. Check those infected ain't getting near us, innit? Yeah, Maddox thought for a second. Get Jagger to take his out. Tell them no taxing, just a quick walk through, or they can use bikes if they want. Check about and get back here. On it, Darius ran off, jogging towards the units. He reminds me of you, Lenski said quietly as they watched the stocky form of Darius moving away. He's a good mate. We're lucky he's with us. He's always had my back. Right, where were we? Counting beds? You ready? You're the dictator, no? So bossy. She laughed and held the pen ready above the paper. Nine. Tonight, then, we take back what's ours. We take that compound and we have the security and the food. Jeff nods round at the gathered congregation all staring at him. He knew he had them ready. Just mention terrorism, babies and drugs and they'll do anything. He was ready to go for the ace up his sleeve and mention it's what Princess Diana would have wanted. Most of these looked old enough to remember her, but he didn't need to. They were hungry and scared. In fact, they had been terrified for days, but a couple of days of not seeing those zombies had given them a bit of confidence that the worst was over and now they could take the compound and live in safety. All of them imagined that the compound was stuffed to the rafters with rooms of fresh food and they could gorge for days and still have enough left to last forever. Once the old man had left... Jeff had continued unopposed and talked them into his plan, convincing them that those poor kids were being drugged and brainwashed by the boss man, who was without doubt the main terrorist. They needed saving. The children needed help, so they were doing this to save the babies, save the children and keep everyone safe. Some had argued that being out at dark was dangerous. Those things moved fast and were evil at night. Jeff successfully counter-argued that none had been seen for a couple of days, that they were all dead and now was the time to strike. A full frontal assault. Everyone was to bring a weapon. Sticks, bats, knives or whatever tools they had lying about. They would charge the gates in the confusion of the night while all the children were inside being injected with heroin and they would take the compound. Save everyone and show them kids how it should be done. As the congregation dispersed from the library with Jeff making them go out a few at a time so there wasn't a mass exodus on the streets, he reminded them to meet back here at sunset. Most of them asked what time that was and had to be told 
it was when the sun went down. Jeff knew the outcome already. He knew that in the confusion of the night, he could slip to the back and watch this lot, whipped up by strong words, charge at the gates and take those little shits out. Then he could get in and claim the prize. He would be the leader, the boss man. He would be in charge and get those women to do what he wanted. An image of being surrounded by tough bodyguards while beautiful council estate girls hung off his arms, a big cigar in his mouth, and ordering his private army to do whatever he wanted. And that fucker that punched him, he would be the first to be killed. Not by Jeff, though, unless it was dark and he could shoot him with a gun from the shadows. Jeff knew he wasn't a brave man. Stupid and foolhardy, but not brave. He would get these idiots to do the dirty work. Touching his broken nose, he grimaced as he looked forward to the night and taking revenge on those little shits. Jeff the boss man. Yeah, that sounded good. Lord Jeff. Baron Jeff. Yeah, that was better. Baron Jeff of the compound. As the last of the filthy, bedraggled survivors filed out with whispered encouragement from soon-to-be Baron Jeff, he looked up at the sky, wishing it was dark now and cursing these long summer days. 10. While Nick drives the boat towards the harbour entrance, a huge, wide-open mouth that stretches back deep into the city and under order to hold a steady speed so we don't break anything, the rest of us set about sorting our kit. Energised and ready now, we've got something to do and somewhere to go. Another mission. On the road and doing things again. Well, on the water anyway, but the meaning is the same. Wake up, steal a boat, then plan a raid on a Navy warship. What more could a supermarket manager ask for other than a kiss from the sexiest woman I've ever seen? Maybe there'll be a dark corner on that ship we can sneak into for a few minutes. Water bottles get refilled. The remaining shotgun shells get handed round, which amounts to four each. Four shots each before we're down to hand weapons. Bloody hell, Blowers was right. That was too close last night. Another few minutes and we could have been finished off. Except we didn't, did we? We got through by the skin of our teeth again, and Darren is dead. His head detached from his body by Dave and kicked down the road just to be sure he doesn't try and staple it back on. But he's gone, and about as much use as a blind fox. But that leaves that girl, Marcy. Will she harbour the same vendetta as Smithy, or leave us alone from now on? My mind becomes a microclimate. A swirling vortex of suggestions, counter-suggestions and ideas as I try to plan ahead. We have to get better weapons, and if I knew there weren't survivors on that bloody island, and if Nick could figure out the missile system, which he probably could, then I'd send a load of British Navy missiles at the damned thing and be done with it. Raise the thing into the sea and Marcy along with it. Dave finds a box of batteries, and with help from Lani, they slide the backs of the radios off and fit new batteries in each one. Checking each works, transmitting and listening, he attaches a radio to each kit bag and pushes fresh batteries into the side pockets. What's the range on those things? I ask. Not far. Maybe a couple of kilometres on flat open ground, less in built up areas. Right, it's better than nothing though. I think now's the time for hot washes if anyone wants them. I'm first. Lani jumps up and grabbing her kit bag, she runs into the ladies' toilet, letting the door swing closed behind her. There's only one male toilet on the ship. Two sinks, so be quick. Tom and Blowers move off first, taking their kit bags and going into the toilets. So you think anyone will be on those ships? I ask Dave and Clarence. Might be. There would have been some personnel on board when it happened, but it's whether they stayed there or not, Clarence replies. Seems a safe place to me. They must have food, fresh water, weapons and big steep sides plus loads of guns if anyone gets too close, like us in a big white boat. We stare at each other as Cookie looks between us. Oh well, I guess we'll find out in a bit. I add cheerily and catch Cookie shrugging as he returns to repacking his kit bag. When my turn comes, I head into the toilet with Dave to stand in front of the small stainless steel sink. We strip down to our underpants with no sense of shame or embarrassment. 
Taking care due to the massive puddles left by the lads messing about, we fold out clothes and set about scrubbing ourselves using the ten seconds of hot water flow we get each time we press the plunger down. Oh, that feels bloody nice. I scrub at my face with the warm water, using soap from the dispenser to lather up and rinse off. So you're all right about going for the ship then, Dave? Yes, Mr Howie. Is the armoury hard to find? It depends on the type of ship. If they've got a marines detachment, maybe Clarence or Blowers might know more than me. Fair one, mate. This hot water feels lovely. Strange, but I don't miss many things, really. I don't miss television or movies, not the radio. I certainly don't miss work, but little things like hot water, coffee and clean clothes. What about you? I don't miss anything. Nothing? Nor Mr Howie. How come? I glance over to see a look of discomfort flash across his face. After the service, everything was, well, it was unstructured. Work was the only thing worth doing, but it was... I can see him struggling to find the words, and the look of confusion on his normally expressionless face roots me to the spot. I want to finish his sentence for him, but something tells me this is the time for listening. Working with you was good, Mr Howie. You had order and structure, but the others didn't. I couldn't cope outside of work. I didn't know what to do every day. I would sit and stare at the walls, train, exercise, sharpen my weapons. It was like I was waiting to get called back up. Only they didn't call me up. The thought of Dave not coping with something is remarkable. But then, in this maelstrom of violence and upheaval, his skills count for everything and he's kept us alive time after time but I know, more than anyone, that his social skills are virtually non-existent. He lacks empathy and understanding of others' feelings and doesn't get half the jokes flying about. But he fits. My God, he fits in and is revered by everyone here. I don't want to say anything contrite or fake, and I remember my dad telling me that sometimes the best response is to say nothing at all. So I do that, which seems to be the right thing, as Dave nods at me and carries on quickly washing. He scrubs his face, neck, armpits and groin first. A squaddy wash, quick and thorough. Get the important bits done first and then do everywhere else. The feet are next, washed, rinsed and dried carefully between the toes. Then he does the rest of his body. I copy his actions and realise that even here, in a small toilet on board a ferry in the middle of the sea, I'm still learning from him. Dave, would you mind showing the lads how you just washed? It sounds stupid, but it's really effective. OK, Mr Howie. Thanks, mate. I don't have to show Lani, though, do I? No, Dave, you don't. Oh, OK. I'll leave that to you, Mr Howie, he says, bluntly, picking his kit bag up and walking out of the bathroom. He pauses at the door and glances back with a quick smile, and he's gone, leaving me with a mouth hanging open and shaking my head. Excitement grows as we make final plans once everyone is washed and groomed, Gathering on the bridge and I try not to notice Lani's glistening wet hair and the tight black vest top she's now wearing and the cargo trousers taken from the fashion store we raided in the town. She looks the part, half soldier, half mercenary and all gorgeous, sultry and stunning. The lads look pink-faced but still stubbly and hard. At least we've all got clean tops and underwear on which, if nothing else, makes us feel cleaner. It's late afternoon I say, looking at the sky. We get on the ship, get the gear and do one back to our fort. I stare round at the faces nodding back, Nick eyeing the controls and staring at the looming grey vessel ahead. What do we do? Nick asks. Go straight at it? Go round a couple of times? How are we getting on board? Looking over, I see what he means. The Navy ship, despite being small for a military vessel, is still much larger than us and the sides are much higher. Hang on, Blower steps to the window and lifts the binoculars to his eyes. Yeah, that's a supply ship. It's RFA. RFA? Nick asks. Royal Fleet Auxiliary. It's not a warship. They use them to supply warships. Food, fuel, medicine, ammunition. Ammo? Cookie exclaims. There'll be shitloads then. Yeah, for the big guns, missiles and anti-aircraft. Maybe not for the rifles, though. It depends. We might get lucky. We watch the vessel come fully into view as Nick slows our boat down. The ship is still way out from the harbour mouth and anchored in position by a huge, thick chain extending out from the front. Closer now, 
and I can see there are no big guns on board. The ship is squat and square-shaped, more like a cargo ship or container vessel. We slowly move round it, lapping in big circles as we stare up and examine the various windows and doors, trying to detect movement. Dave takes the binoculars and sweeps them over and over up and down the ship. Anyone see anything? I ask and get a chorus of negative replies. Lifeboat's missing, Blowers points to a gap on the side of the ship. From the symmetrical flow of the vessel, I can see he must be right. There is a gap where a lifeboat should be. Someone used it and got away then, he asks. Could be. It certainly indicates some kind of movement. I reply into the tense silence. Have we got a loudspeaker or anything on here? Here, try this. Nick hands me a bullhorn with a black radio mouthpiece attached by a curly cable. Taking the loud hailer outside, I face towards the ship and shout into the black mouthpiece. Can you hear me? Is anyone on board? Nick tries to hold the boat steady while I shout repeatedly through the hailer, eventually giving up when I see Dave staring at me. Handing it over, I stand well back and get ready to flinch. Is anyone on board? Dave's voice booms like a cannon across the water, and I can imagine people in Scotland turning round to see who was gobbing off. He repeats it several times as Nick struggles to control the vessel, drifting us closer and closer to the Navy ship. Nick, wash out, mate! Blower shouts as he tries to engage the engines and pull us away. A loud clunk sounds out, followed by a vibration and a belch of black smoke spurting out the back. Then... Silence as the engines cut out. Nick! Cookie shouts in warning. The engines have stopped, Nick! Yeah, I can see that! Nick shouts back, pressing buttons and desperately trying to figure it out. Nick! Cookie yells again. That ship is getting closer, mate! It won't start! Nick shouts in alarm. Someone check the engine room! I'll go! Lani runs to the back of the top deck and nimbly drops down the steps disappearing from view as we gather round the console, trying to help a very flustered Nick. What about this? Blowers asks, pointing at buttons, flashing. A low alarm sounds from the console, steadily getting louder and faster. Nick, any ideas what that alarm is, mate? I keep my voice calm, trying not to get him more flustered. The ship's on fire! Lani's loud voice comes from the back. We all freeze, staring at each other, then burst off and try to get through the door at once. Thick black smoke billowing from the engine room as Lani climbs back up the stairs with her hand covering her mouth. It's raging in there, she shouts. What happened? Nick demands with a look of wild confusion. Forget it, I shout. Get your kit bags. Nick, try and aim us for the side of that ship. We need some rope. Everyone scatters, bursting into action, running back down into the passenger section and grabbing kit bags and axes, passing them back up onto the bridge and out onto the top open-air deck. The smoke starts to seep into the passenger section as Clarence rushes to the back and closes the door, sealing the air off and preventing the choking fumes from coming in. Blowers and Tom run outside and along the side of the ship to the front, grabbing ropes and looping them arm over arm. What did I say? I mutter to Dave as he passes the kit bags out onto the deck. Every bloody half hour. I'm so sorry, Mr Howie. I must have done something wrong. Maybe didn't vent something or release pressure. It's really complicated and I... Nick, Nick, take it easy, mate. I say softly to the lad, clearly racked with guilt. These things happen, mate. It's not your fault. But you said something happens every half hour, Nick wails. Yep, and it bloody does, I reply with a grin. If it wasn't this, it would be Cookie smashing a hole somewhere, or Blowers blocking the toilet up and making a sink, or me doing something stupid. It happens, mate. Forget it. How are we going to skewer the rope to the side? Lani asks as Blowers and Tom clamber back through the bridge carrying the long ropes. Tie an axe on. Dave grabs my double-headed beauty and stupidly I feel a sense of panic at the thought of it getting broken. Nick negotiates the burning catamaran towards the grey bulk of the Navy vessel. The supply ship sides are high at the front and back, with a wide, flat lower section in the middle and a crane positioned in the middle ready for moving heavy goods. It's the lower middle section we aim for as Nick tries his best to pilot the drifting boat. Fortunately, the weather is still gloriously hot and still with no wind or high waves to cause us more difficulty. As the ships near each other, 
Clarence grabs the tied-on axe and stands back. With no choice as to the angle of approach, the front of our vessel gets closer and closer to the rear section. Knowing we'll impact and drag alongside, Clarence braces his feet and starts unwinding the rope and making sure nothing will tangle. Almost there, Lani shouts to Nick. Seconds of bated breath pass, then a heavy jolt and a screech of metal as the front of the catamaran crumples from the solid metal side of the Navy ship. Clarence holds for a second, waiting as the two vessels come together side by side, and with no engine noise and no wind, the sound of metal against metal is ear-splittingly loud. With a grunt, Clarence launches the axe up high and over the side of the lower middle section still ten feet above our heads. As soon as the axe lands with a clang, he starts winding it back in. We watch and wait for the axe to catch, but it appears over the top and drops back down. With a curse, Clarence quickly winds it back in and launches it again. Pulling the rope, it holds taut. He tugs a few times, making the muscles in his arms bulge. The rope holds tight, and I tie the end onto the metal safety railing of the top deck. I'll go first, Lani shouts, her pack already on her back. Hands free, she climbs onto the top of the railing and grabs the rope, showing her deft climbing skills as she quickly scales the rope and reaches the top of the ship, pulling herself up. She stares down into the hidden ship's interior for a few seconds before straddling the side and looking back down. You all right? I call up, concerned at her expression. We've got some company, she says, not too loud. Oh, how many? Only a few. Really? Out here? Bloody hell. Nothing surprises me anymore. Dave, on hearing that there might be potential foes he can play with, is up the rope like a rat down a pipe. On reaching the top, he too stares down before straddling the top and looking at Lani before staring back down at us. There's more than a few, isn't there? I ask him. He nods once, then motions towards the middle at whatever sight we can't see. No, Dave, you wait for us and don't kill them before we get there. I can see he's itching to make a start. Lads, you go next. They scramble up, getting pulled by Dave and Lani as they reach the top. They too look down into the middle, and I still can't see before glancing back down and somehow inching along to all remain straddling at the edge of the side. Just how many are down there? Clarence asks with concern at seeing them all perch precariously on the edge. We'll find out in a minute. You going next? I ask him. I might break the rope, he mutters. You should go. Get off, you aren't that heavy, are you? I ask with a smile. He grins back and climbs up to take the rope and pull himself hand over hand to the top. His feet on the side of the ship, walking up until he too gets to the top, looks down, and then I see his bald head looking left, then right, and finally he twists round to me with a huge grin. Oh, you're going to love this, boss. Taking the rope, I pull myself up, feeling bad at poor Nick losing the ship he struggled so hard to get. It was a pity we couldn't keep it for a bit longer and rest up, though. Reaching the top, Clarence leans down and decides to try and pull my arm away from my body by grabbing my wrist and lifting me up. Reaching the top, I glance down and see Dave reaching over and cutting the rope with his knife. With the tension released, the white catamaran continues scraping slowly down the side of the ship, screeching metal against metal, thick, oily smoke pouring from the back. I hope the tide pulls it away, I mutter quietly, thinking that knowing our luck will probably burn down the navy too. Then I turn to look at the interior of the ship, at the faces staring up. Drooling faces with red bloodshot eyes, pale skin a deathly pallor, cuts and bite marks evident as limbs hang loosely down at sides, the fetid stench of decaying flesh from sailors still wearing dirty overalls and the navy blue colours of the... well, the navy, I guess. More than that, there are zombies in smart suits, ball gowns and dinner jackets, waiters and chefs, chavs dressed in cheap sparkly nightclub outfits, bouncers in black suits. How the hell they all got onto a naval supply ship in the middle of the sea, I don't know. But what I do know is that there is a lot of them. Hundreds, in fact. The middle area is packed deep, and every single undead face is staring at us. A face off and no way of getting into the ship's buildings without going through them. Dave has already drawn his knives. The lads have gripped their axes ready. 
Lani has her meat cleaver and Clarence is cracking his knuckles. We're all grinning now. Grinning like the bloody idiots we are. I'm telling you, slaying zombies is addictive. Very addictive. Why are they all here? Cookie asks as we stare down at the massed horde. They must have been brought out in boats when it started, probably thinking it was the safest place, I reply, figuring it's the only thing that makes sense and it would explain the eclectic mix of personnel on board. That all went well then, Lani says abruptly, getting looks of surprise from the rest of us. What? She shrugs. It's true. Yeah, fair one. Right, which way are we heading? It's got to be into that structure at the back, surely. Probably. Clarence nods, staring round like the rest of us and trying to see any other ways into the ship's hold or storage areas. Blowers, you got any ideas? No, Mr. Owie. Aim for the big building at the back like you said. Okay. Do any of them look like super zombies? Heads not lolling, not drooling, or maybe a fake zombie pretending to drool and loll its head? As ridiculous as the question is, they all respond seriously scanning the hundreds of faces and checking for any signs of one of them not being a normal daytime shuffler. Dave, anything? No, Mr Howie, they all look the same. OK, right, well I guess we should crack on then. Bags the eye go first. Second, Dave adds with a lightning fast response, with everyone else shouting, third, at the same time, and arguing about who got it out quickest. Ready, Dave? Yes, Mr. Howie, he says, and drops down to land in the middle of a batch of waiter-dressed zombies. They seem almost surprised to see him there, and it takes a fraction of a second for them to respond and turn into him, by which time he's grinning like a maniac, back at the rest of us while I shout he's a cheating bastard and launch myself down. But it's too late. Dave has started and drawn first blood, and second, and third, possibly fourth, and maybe I got fifth by the time gravity assisted me landing, and I pulled the axe back and swung out, muttering that he was unsporting and a cheat, and the next time we went at a horde, I wouldn't warn him. I hear Clarence laughing like a braying donkey again at the sight of Dave dropping down and beating us all to it, but then they all join in, dropping down and setting about the shufflers with unabated glee. No precision or uniformity here just slaughter. My axe swings back and forth with both keen sharp edges slicing, chopping, cleaving and breaking bodies open. The shufflers don't stand a chance and we move steadily deeper into their ranks, Nick, Blowers, Cookie and Tom shouting out the numbers of their kills with a competition. Six, seven, eight, Blowers shouts in the lead. Nine, ha, no, ten now. Twenty-one, twenty-two, 23, Dave roars out from several metres away as he glides through the air with his blades whipping out, slicing jugulars open and stabbing into chests. You're banned for cheating, I shout as a zombie in a ball gown with a heaving cleavage lunges at me with bared teeth and gets an axe to the face in response. 12, Lani shouts in triumph. 13, Tom roars and adds another one as he lashes out, decapitating a zombie. The numbers are shouted as the competition heats up, and I notice Blowers and Cookie have instinctively teamed up as normal, fighting side by side. Tom and Nick now doing the same. Clarence off by himself, crushing skulls, and Dave just getting warmed up as he spins, drops, leaps and kills with every lunge and twist. Lani stays close to me, just a few steps away, and I watch the savage ferocity she uses. The meat cleaver is deadly in her hands, whipping out and slicing faces, necks and shoulders. Her amazing athletic ability really shows in close quarters as she bends and flexes, taking high steps like a dancer, planting her feet and using her body weight in the thrust and slash. Her face is alive, eyes determined. She uses her free hand to clutch the hair of an undead and force it down before she hacks into the neck. Letting go and moving off to drop down and swing the blade deep into the throat of the next one. She kicks back, impacting into the stomach of a woman undead lunging for her. One full turn and she's on the still reeling body, opening a hole in its stomach, intestines spilling out. Watching Lani is like watching Dave. It's beautiful, graceful and fluid. The rest of us are progressive and we kill as well as her, but it's the way they do it. Art, beauty and grace. As the bodies drop, I find a space round me and lean on my axe, watching between Lani and Dave dancing through them. 
both of them warmed up now and spinning like some amazing act on a stage. Clarence glances over and catches me skiving, giving me a puzzled look. I nod towards the two in the centre of the open middle section of the ship. He quickly punches one zombie hard, breaking its neck and clearing the view as he watches what I see. He nods over at me, leaning his back against the wall and watching as mesmerised as me. The lads soon do the same as they realise Clarence and I are stood still and watching. Slowly, we shuffle back to the sides and let Lani and Dave work in a free space. There are still good numbers of undead, and we stand ready to step in, but really, there is no need. They're like ballet dancers, poetry in motion, lithe bodies that are exactly where they need to be. Lani lacks Dave's experience and strength, but the symmetry of her body, the hair flowing and waving behind her, more than makes up for that. As long as I draw breath on this earth, I will never tire of watching Dave do this. And now with Lani doing something similar, it is simply stunning. A spectacle never seen by humanity. Utter, ruthless killers, relentless in their capacity for murder, devastating in their glory, but simply breathtaking in their delivery. Have you ever seen anything like that? I ask softly. No, Clarence replies instantly. Even his deep voice is full of awe. Jesus, look at him, Tom whispers, as Dave spots another solid group still shuffling towards him. He runs at them, long strides and launching himself high at the very last second. His feet push down into the faces of two, sending them toppling backwards and knocking several more over. Dave lands in the middle with one arm extended and the blade buried deep into the heart of one undead while his trailing arm extends behind him, again with the blade buried deep into a spinal column. He wrenches the blades out and stands upright, like at attention before spinning round and lashing his arms out. Three more fall with bright crimson sprays of blood spurting out in high arcs as their throats are cut. As we mere mortals watch the high spray, he's already gone round behind two more and drawn his blades across two more throats. Then it's over, and the ground is once again littered with the broken bodies of the undead. Blood everywhere, bits of brain, bone and tendons glisten wetly in the sun. The metallic smell of blood mixes with the odour of decaying skin. Dave drops down and wipes his blades repeatedly on the clothing of the undead. Lani, standing still and checking round, sees they're all down, and turns to see us all staring at her and Dave. She smiles with a sudden intensity and locks eyes with me, making my heart skip a beat and my face flushes red. Bloody hell, Lani, that was fucking awesome! Cookie shouts with genuine amazement and walks towards her. The lads rush in, congratulating the girl as she nods and smiles with humble thanks and wipes the sweat from her forehead. Drinking water and washing the blood from our hands, taking care to use the antibacterial wipes on our skin, we make our way carefully towards the superstructure at the back, stepping over corpses. Here, Dave drops down quickly and reaches down to pull something from underneath a body. Holding the object between thumb and finger, he holds his hand out, showing us the shiny brass casing of the bullet. Someone got some rounds off then, Clarence scans about towing bodies out the way and spotting more casings on the floor. We thread our way towards the structure, examining the ground. Here. Tom leans his arm in between a gap at the base of the crane structure, pulling an SA-80 assault rifle out. Dave strides over and takes the weapon from him, snapping the magazine off and checking the weapon through. Empty, he calls out. Emptied the magazine and I guess whoever had it ditched it and went for his sidearm instead of changing magazine. This would have been packed, just one of them bitten or infected, and it would have been nuts. Must have been a soldier on guard or something. I look round, imagining the scene of chaos unfolding at the infection spread from bite to bite, the screams and yells, and the terror sweeping through. Doors open. Clarence, having taken a few steps closer to the structure, spots the open door at the base and calls back, his axe gripped and ready in his hands. It's a big building, I say, looking up at the structure, several stories high, and no doubt with further levels underneath us too. Do we clear the lot, or just go for what we need and get out? Get what we need and get out, Clarence advises. We'll be here for hours clearing it. How do we get out? Lani asks quickly. Go for the orange lifeboats. 
They'll have quick release mechanisms inside. They'll slide down the frame and land in the water, Clarence explains. Right, if it goes bent, then we go for them. Let's go. I nod at the door and walk towards it. Dave shoulders the assault rifle and keeps one knife ready while the rest of us grip axes. The cool interior is a relief after the strong, direct sun on the deck of the ship, and we proceed down a long corridor. Clarence out front and the rest of us trailing behind in a long line with Dave bringing up the rear. Dried blood is smeared everywhere, on the floor, the walls, and even splashed onto the ceiling. Dead bodies lie here and there, dropped from shots to the head and chest. More bullet casings lead a breadcrumb trail into the ship's interior. A frantic firefight took place here. A retreating fire and manoeuvre, possibly, as the undead surged towards whoever was left alive and firing. We reach the base of a set of stairs leading up and find more bodies stacked up with the butt of an assault rifle poking out from under the entwined limbs. Blowers pulls it out and uses the shirt tails from a downed undead to wipe the blood and filth away. Another SA-80, the standard issue British military assault rifle and a weapon most of us are familiar with. Blowers quickly checks the gun and like the one found by Dave, he finds it empty. Used as a bat, Blowers points to the dried bits of skull and matted hair on the butt of the weapon. That's two. Just need some bullets now, I say quietly. Hang on. Clarence shoves his foot into the pile of bodies and starts punting them aside, separating them. The few of us close enough help out, dragging the bodies apart looking for more weapons. A camouflaged soldier is at the bottom of the pile. The smell of decay mixed with shit and blood is almost too much, and I notice a few of us try not to gag. Clarence bends down and grips the front of the soldier's thick shirt, lifting him bodily up from the ground. Get the pistol, he says through gritted teeth while trying to face away from the stench. Tom reaches out and unclasps the utility belt round the dead soldier's waist, lifting the belt and the attached pistol away. Clarence drops the body and we retreat a few steps, Tom handing the belt to Dave, who pulls the standard issue pistol out and finds it unused with a full magazine clip and two more full magazines on the belt. They're the same as ours? Cookie asks. Even his normal jovial voice is quiet and restrained. Yes, Dave answers. He checks the pistol through, sliding the top back and checking the moving parts before handing one magazine to Clarence and the other to me. We both pull our pistols from our belts and insert the magazines into the grips, sliding the tops back and making ready. Yay, we're back, Cookie smiles, still quietly. Not quite, mate, I reply just as quietly. We've got one door there and stairs going up. Which way? Go through the door. We should check down before we go up, Dave replies. Tom and Cookie take our axes. Dave up front with Clarence at the rear. I'll go behind Dave. They nod back as the weapons are handed over. Dave slides his knife away and holds the pistol in a double-handed grip as he stalks towards the door. I copy his actions and hold mine ready, lowered to the floor. Reaching the door, he checks my position before checking the door is open with his foot. No resistance and the door starts opening. He pushes it quickly and steps through, holding the pistol high and scanning all about. I step in behind him and check about. Another corridor leads off down the width of the ship, doors to the left and right, all of them closed. Dave motions he's taking the left, and I nod, stepping to the right and moving towards the first door. I figure he'll want them done one at a time, so I pause while he kicks the first one open and steps in. He's back out within a second and nodding to me. I repeat his actions, kick the door and step in. A small office with a desk, a computer, charts and folders scattered everywhere, bloody handprints smeared about. Gradually, one at a time, the rooms are all cleared. Left, right, left, right, and we make progress. The rooms are all office space, desks and computers, charts, folders, paperwork. We find one more body in a room. A uniformed naval person slumped on the floor with a bullet wound to the head, the pistol laying just inches away from his open hand. Clear suicide, and we retrieve the pistol, passing it to Blowers, who clears and checks the weapon. Reaching the end of the passageway, we stop before a wide lift, doors open and prevented from closing by the body slumped half in, the face chewed off, 
Thick, crusty blood pooled under the head and flies buzzing noisily in the enclosed area. Stairs. Dave points to the end and a set of stairs leading down. Taking point again, he leads the way and starts heading down into the depths of the ship. No power now, and we have to pause and pull torches from our bags to light the way in the gloom. Two flights down, and we come to another landing. More stairs lead down. Two sets of double doors, one clearly leading towards the front of the ship and into the big middle hold area, and another leading into a passageway running the width of the ship, just like the last one. Passageway first. I nod at the doors and move behind Dave as we repeat the motions, kicking doors open and quickly checking rooms. Most of these are private quarters, with cot beds and small cupboards. Being below the main level of the ship, there are no windows, no natural light. The torches illuminate ahead of us, but just accentuate the dark patches and make the shadows look deeper. The ship is inert, lifeless. Our feet echo on the floor. Scrapes and scuff noises sound out as we move along. The kicks to the doors bang alarmingly, and we all feel the tension rising. Heavy breathing, and the air is significantly cooler down here. The corridor is cleared, and we head back down to the stairs and the next double doors leading into the ship's hold. Pushing through, we enter into an almost pitch black room that must be almost the width of the ship and stretching out towards the front. The only light coming from the meagre grey of the open doors. We hold at the door for a few seconds, carefully listening but hearing nothing other than the creak of the ship. Square columns are stacked throughout the room. We shine our torches into the gloom and can see their pallets of goods wrapped in plastic, ready to be hoisted or lifted onto other vessels. With so many of them stacked throughout the room, we can't see further than a few metres. Spread out, I say softly, and wait until a long line is formed and we start pressing into the big room. Torchlight glances about, sweeping left and right, soft footsteps, and we make our way round the sinister-looking columns. The doors closed behind us, and the harsh torchlight is the only illumination now, and that just makes the shadows seem deeper. Our footsteps echo softly, breaths exhaling. The rustle of trouser legs brushing as steps are taken. The slight clink of equipment. We advance slowly, one step at a time. We pass the first columns, heading further into the darkness and now feeling oppressed from the sentry-like stacks of goods behind us. Torchlight dances about, sweeping the ground and the columns all around us, each one of them much taller than a man. The smell hits me. Rancid meat left to rot. A truly awful stench of putrid foulness. Is that the smell from the food or from the zombies? Cookie asks with a gagging sound. Stay quiet, Dave whispers, and I wonder if anything ever bothers that man. A sudden low groan holds us all in place. One long single groan and our hearts race at the unmistakable sound of an undead. We freeze stock still as the noise echoes round the room, none of us able to pinpoint the direction it came from. Glancing round, I can't even see the others that clearly, just bright orbs of light from the torches. Another groan rolls round the room, low and deep. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up, but I still can't tell where it's coming from, but it sounds different to the first one. The beams of torchlight sweep round quickly, and I grip the pistol, raising it up to point into the darkness. Feet shuffling on the floor, heard but unseen. Groans straight ahead, then off to the left and then the right. Groans from all around us, a feeling of being surrounded. Our torches make us instantly visible. Beacons of light being circled by an enemy unseen. A piercing howl rips through the air as the twisted features of a zombie come running into view, drawn to my torchlight like a moth to a flame. The thing launches itself at me, moving quickly, head fixed and staring. Shit! No light down here! Not shufflers! I shout in warning and raise the pistol, firing several times into the mass coming at me. The retort of the pistol is deafening in this enclosed space. The muzzle flash is blinding, but I see the thing drop down to lie twitching on the ground. More shots ring out, single and double taps that drown any other sound out. My ears are ringing, and I can't hear them shuffle or groan. Get into a circle, I shout. On me, on me! I repeat the calls and flick my torch on and off so they can find the way to go. 
More howls pierce the air as zombies rush into the light. A sudden transition from dark to light, teeth bared and heads already lunging forward. Shouts of alarm and pistol shots ring out. Bodies hit the ground as the undead are shot down. We get into our basic fighting circle, backs together and facing out. Incoming! Dave bellows as undead bodies launch themselves at us. Pistols fire quickly as we expend the valuable ammunition. They click empty and we're once more back to hand weapons, fending off the savage frenzied attacks, swiping out with vicious swings and shouts of anger as the things lunge from the darkness, holding our weapons one-handed so we can grip the vital torches. Our circle spins and twists as more bodies come flying from the darkness to meet a grisly end from heavy axe or sharp knife. I've lost sense of direction, Clarence shouts out. We all have from the darkness and the spinning round. None of us are able to tell which way to go. Another zombie lunges in, screeching with venomous hatred as Dave darts out and takes it down. More rush in from all sides and I grip the torch between my teeth so I can use two hands on the axe. Dave gets swallowed up in the darkness as the rest of us fight with desperation, hand-to-hand -hand combat with nighttime zombies in the pitch black of an echoing ship's hold. Grunts of exertion sound out as we lunge and swipe, trying to hold our circle. Dave! I shout, during a quick break in the fighting and removing the torch from my mouth. Here! Dave shouts from the gloom. Doesn't really help, mate! I shout back. Be quiet, please, and let me listen, he shouts back, and we all go silent, holding position and trying not to make any noise. Can you turn the torches off for a second? Dave shouts. No! He gets a chorus of replies. OK, he shouts back. The sound of bodies hitting the ground reach us as Dave somehow manages to move between them. Here, zombies! Here, zombies! Dave shouts into the room, flashing his torch on and off, trying to draw the things to him. They kindly respond, and we hear the wet ripping sound of his knives tearing flesh open, followed by the thuds of bodies dropping. Come in! Don't shoot! Dave appears from behind a column and takes his place next to me. We don't have any bullets left, Dave, Clarence says pointedly. Well, just in case, Dave replies. How many did you get? Tom asks. Eight, Dave answers instantly. Oh, Tom says quietly. Keeping our formation, we move slowly through the hold, stepping on and over bodies, torches shining out and trying to find the way. Over here, Blower shouts. There's a switch to open the roof up. Will it work with the engines off? Tom asks. Fucking try it, Cookie yells. We crab sideways, heading towards the side and a big red lever next to a large grey electrical box. A big white arrow points upwards with the word roof stenciled next to it. Reaching the side, Blowers grips the handle and pulls it down. Flashing lights and an alarm sounds out as a hydraulic whine starts up. Incoming! Lani shouts, as more undead come lurching from the deep, dark shadows. The sudden sight of them caught in the torchlight is terrifying. Ghostly white faces with dried blood and horrific injuries, flesh torn open and clothes hanging off them, clawed hands held out, and the red bloodshot eyes almost shining in the reflection from the torches. We fight and kill as a tiny sliver of light forms in the roof. More undead stagger as we hold our position and fight out. The gap in the roof widens as the blessed light starts shining down, hurting even our eyes from the near pitch blackness of the hold. The light floods a small, long, narrow strip on the floor, and I watch as a zombie runs from the darkness and crosses the light. As the daylight hits his face, he slows instantly and starts to shuffle, but passes back into the night and suddenly becomes animated again, howling and continuing his jerky running. We hold our position as the gap widens. Then a heavy thud sounds out from a body, falling through the widening gap to land in the strip of light. What the fuck is that? Nick shouts. The body's from the top. They're falling through the gap, Blowers shouts in reply. Eyes on! Dave roars and darts out to take a charging zombie down. More sickening heavy thuds as the bodies we killed on the deck fall through the doors, pulling back. Fuck, it's raining zombies, Cookie jokes. Shit, watch out. We burst apart as a body falls inches in front of us. 
With no choice but to split up, we move out trying to avoid the falling zombies and the ones still running in to attack us. Get in the light, I shout, and move into the widening strip of daylight now stretching across the room. The rest get into line either side of me as we stand in the light, dancing between the bodies, sliding off the retracting roof. Zombies stagger in to attack, but instantly slow as the light hits them, making our killing easier. The instant transformation is incredible. Quick-moving beasts turning instantly into the drooling shufflers. It's over within a couple of minutes. We stay within the light, moving out and killing them off as they turn slow. Eventually, we're in full glorious daylight and once again surrounded by hundreds of bodies. Now that's worth knowing, Nick says with a full spin round. No light, so they didn't know if it was night or day. By the skin of our teeth again, Cookie grimaces. What was that you said, Mr Owie, about every half hour? Bloody fact, Cookie. Spread out and see what we've got here. With the light now shining down, we move through the large hold, stepping over the bodies and examining the stacks and piles of goods, most of them food and cleaning materials. Engine parts, spare machine bits, each column has a manifesto stuck to the side. Tinned fruit, Tom shouts in an excited voice and starts attacking the plastic film, ripping it away to pull the boxes down onto the deck. We gather round and scoop the plain tins up, shoving several into our kit bags for later. There, Dave points to a smaller pallet, a big wooden crate with a locked lid secured by a numbered security tag. He jogs over and kicks down on the clasp, snapping it free. Wrenching the top back, he delves in and starts pulling boxes out, dumping them on the ground. Gathering round, we give a low cheer at the sight of the wooden lids marked with 5.56, the standard size of ammunition for the SA-80 assault rifle. Dave prizes the lids open, and we find preloaded magazines wrapped in greaseproof paper. Get as many as you can, Dave says quietly and rather needlessly as we drop down and start filling every spare inch of our kit bags with the magazines. Dave and Blowers load the two recovered assault rifles. This is like Christmas, Cookie laughs. Any pistols round there? No, Dave replies, lifting the boxes from the pallets and checking the lid of each before stacking them to one side. At the bottom of the pile, two larger boxes form the base, both locked, secured with multiple security tags. Bingo! Clarence clearly recognises the boxes and bends down to rip the lids off with his bare hands, pulling the new and shiny assault rifles out. Oh, look at them, Nick says in awe. Hello, babies. Oh, we've missed you. He takes one of the weapons, his hands moving deftly over the weapon. He strips the plastic cover off and slides the bolt back, checking down the sights, hefting the weapon to his shoulder and then starting on the strap, getting it to the length he wants. Have you used these before, Tom? Clarence asked. Not these. I fired the police weapons on the range during an assessment for the firearms teams, Tom replies. Lani? Clarence looks to the woman. No, never, Lani shakes her head. Boss, all right if I quickly run them through the basics? Crack on, mate. Here, take these. I hand Lani and Tom a weapon each and watch as they step away with Clarence. He drops down into a crouch and starts running them through the weapon's basic moving parts, naming each part separately. This is a good day, I mutter to the rest of them as they strip the covers off and load their weapons. A very good day. Apart from Nick breaking the pier and then setting our boat on fire, Cookie adds quickly. Fuck you, I don't know how that fire started, Nick retorted defensively. I'm joking, mate, Cookie said softly. Just don't break this one. Fuck off, Cookie. The banter starts as I think how lucky this find was. But then it wasn't all luck. It was us, planning and working out the best way to make our luck. We got the ship, we killed the zombies, and risked our lives to get the prize. With these weapons, we stand a much greater chance of survival, and I'm already trying to figure out how to carry more of the ammunition with us. Anything else down here? I asked Dave. We could do with ammunition for the pistols and the GPMG. Fuck it, we might find another GPMG, Blowers adds, hopefully. How are we going to carry it all? Cookie asks. Load a lifeboat, get to shore and find a vehicle. Easy, Blower shrugs. 
we'll take what we can now and come back later, Cookie argues. What's the point in that? Nick asks. Just take everything we can now, like Blower said. Someone else could have seen us getting on here, especially with that ferry boat pissing smoke out like that. We might lose it if we leave it here, Blowers continues. Okay, Cookie nods. Yeah, fair enough then, makes sense, the lad concedes. Mr Howie, can I take Blowers and start searching for the armoury while you check the other stacks here, Dave offers. Okay, mate, do that. Nick, Cookie, you start checking the other stacks. Hang on, we got those radios. Use them. We all reach for the radios on our bags and switch them on, each one blaring out with a second of static before locking onto the signal. Shout if you get any contact, I call out as they start moving away. You too, Mr Howie, Dave replies, and they move off swiftly. Nick, Cookie and I start moving round the remaining stacks, checking the typed manifestos. Dave to Mr Howie, radio check, over. Howie to Dave, loud and clear, over. Dave to Mr. Howie, likewise, out. Cookie to Blowers, radio check, over. Blowers to Cookie, loud and clear, over. Cookie to Blowers, does this take you back? Being surrounded by seamen, over. Dave to Cookie, radio discipline from now, out. Sorry, Dave. Cookie replaces the radio, and I have to turn away as I giggle gently, and once again ponder how the lads can make the word Dave sound like Sarge. Looking over, I see Clarence shaking his head at Cookie with a wry smile and trying not to laugh too before turning back to Lani and Tom. The stacks all contain rice, pasta, flour and basic ingredients, cleaning materials, soaps and bleaches, disinfectants and scrubbing pads, tinned food, lots of tinned food. One pallet even contains replacement uniforms and boxes of new boots. We strip that one apart and root through the boxes, but they're all high-visibility stuff and big, clumpy steel toe-cap work boots. Before too long, Clarence has got Lani and Tom dry-firing and changing magazines, shouting out when they do so. He drills them over and again, and I watch as the intelligence shows as they grasp the basics with ease. Blowers to Mr Howie, over. Howie to blowers, go ahead. We've got ribs here. All ready to go for launching. We can load them up and use them. Over. How will we get them off the ship? Over. There's a big hatch thing here with a winch. We can open it and lower the boats down. Over. Roger. Where are you? We'll start bringing the stuff through. Go to the end, through the doors and down the corridor. I'll meet you there. Over. Okay, mate. On way. Pushing the radio back on my belt, we all converge on the boxes of ammunition and try to take one each, which is easy for Clarence, but the rest of us end up sharing one box between two and moving through the hold towards the end. By the time we get there, Blowers is already in the corridor, grinning widely and nodding his head for us to follow him. Down the short passage and through another set of doors into a wide open room containing two army Land Rovers, bicycles, and a big, powerful-looking rib with an oversized rubber skirt and a mean-looking engine on the back. Four hooks, two at the front and two at the rear, connect the rib to long chains hanging from a winch, and the wall next to the boat looks to be a roll-up shutter. Moving quickly, all of us feeling a strange sense of oppression from the dark, inert ship, we dump the ammunition crates and head back into the hold for more. Dave and Blowers head off to complete their sweep for the armoury in the hope of finding ammunition for the GPMG. Nick, see if you can get that door open. I point at the rolling shutter and the complicated set of controls on the wall for using the shutter and the winch, and an extended vehicle ramp used for the vehicles to be driven. Using his torch, Nick examines the controls and pulls levers up and down. Eventually, he finds a manual override and starts winding a hand winch. The shutter creaks, groans and starts lifting slowly as a thin sliver of welcome daylight floods in. Taking it in turns with Tom, the two of them winch the door open as the rest of us load the boxes onto the floor of the rib, trying to keep the weight balanced. Do we get it in before it's winched down? Cookie asks, looking between the rib and the opening hatch. No idea, mate. We'll figure something out in a minute, I reply as I reach for the radio on my belt. Howie to Dave, you got anything yet? Dave to Mr. Howie, not yet, over. Howie to Dave, okay, we want to be back in our fort before dark though. I don't fancy spending the night on this ship, there could be loads of them left on here. 
Dave to Mr. Howie, understood, out. There's a scramble net here, Nick says, pulling a bundle of knitted ropes out from a locker in the ground. We just roll this down and climb down it. Nice one, mate. I think we're just about ready. I walk over to the now open hatch and stand staring down at the almost perfectly flat surface of the sea. It looks so inviting and just ready to be plunged into. The sultry warm air makes it feel Mediterranean, almost tropical. Perfect holiday weather and just right for dozing on a beach, reading a book and sipping a cold beer. Looks beautiful, Lani says quietly from beside me. I glance over at her own sultry good looks, almost tropical in appearance with her long black hair and tanned skin. Definitely, I reply, and she smiles, keeping her gaze out to sea and not turning to look at me. I meant the view, she says. Me too. I laugh softly and turn away to see Nick lighting a smoke up, leaning against the wall and exhaling a soft cloud of smoke. He nods and offers me his packet. I nod back so he throws it over and I tap one out, taking my lighter from my pocket and igniting the end, savouring the harshness of the smoke pulled down my throat. Cookie sits down on the edge of the rib and rubs his face while Clarence moves round the room examining the Land Rovers and bicycles. These take me back. His deep voice drifts over. We used to use Landys all the time. Pity we can't take one with us. I don't think we'll get it into the rib, mate, I reply but I'm sure Nick would have a go at driving the boat into the shore if you want. No thanks, boss. Clarence appears round the front of the vehicle, grinning at Nick. Not after the last one, eh? Oh, I'm really sorry about that, Nick grumbles. I really don't know what happened. Dave to Mr Howie. My radio bursts to life. Go ahead, over. We found the armoury. Who needs a rifle? I think we all got one now from the new ones in the boxes. Grab some spares, though. Do you need a hand? No, there's a trolley jack here. We'll be back in five. Out. OK, mate. We chat amiably for a few minutes until we hear a steady squeak coming from the end of the room. Dave and Blowers appear pushing a low trolley with one squeaking wheel, Blowers grinning like the devil himself, and Dave looking as devoid of expression as ever. What you grinning at, Blowers? Cookie asks with a laugh. Ta-da! Blowers pulls a cover from the trolley to reveal a long machine gun, the front lifted up on a tripod. Very nice. Clarence steps over and hefts the general purpose machine gun from the trolley, holding it one-handed and instantly looking like a bald Rambo. Suits you, mate. I smile at him as Dave lifts a few heavy boxes of ammunition belts from the trolley. You fucking beauty, Nick calls out as he scoots over to Clarence and starts examining the weapon. It's huge, Lani says with a shocked face. Is that the GP thing you keep mentioning? GPMG. It means General Purpose Machine Gun, and it has proven to be one of our most effective weapons in the fight against the zombie invasion, Clarence explains. So that's better than these. Lani lifts her assault rifle and looks between the two. That uses 5.56 rounds. This uses 7.62. Bigger rounds, more firepower, greater range. It's belt-fed too, which means less stoppage for magazine changes, Clarence replies. They're bloody good, Blowers adds. Really bloody good, Nick grins. I feel better now we're tooled up properly again. I know what you mean, mate. Right, let's get out of here. I don't like this ship. We unload the trolley into the rib, distributing the weight evenly. Dave and Blowers also found pistol magazines in the armoury and hand them round until we're each equipped with a loaded pistol and spare magazines. Assault rifles and lots of spare magazines, a sawn-off shotgun with hardly any shells, axes, meat cleavers and knives, trousers tucked into boots, tight tops and we look like a nasty bunch of bastards ready to overthrow some small country. The rib gets winched up, swung out and lowered down the side of the vessel until it plops onto the surface of the water. The scramble net is rolled down, and we start the descend, going hand over hand until we reach the boat and balance precariously on the rubber skirt and hop onto the solid base. Dave is the last one down. And once on board, we detach the hooks from the winch and push the rib away from the ship 
while Nick goes to the central column and gets the engine going. Minutes later, and we're steadily cruising away from the Navy supply ship, fully loaded with weapons and enjoying the wind blowing against our faces. Nick takes it steadily, not wanting to risk the valuable cargo, and heads us away from the mouth of Portsmouth Harbour, moving along the coast towards our fort. 11. Jagger moves quickly with his patrol stretched out behind him. 16 years old, of mixed race background, and he was a switched on kid. Coming from a heartbreaking background of abuse, neglect and poverty, he took to the streets from an early age and did what it took to survive and get through the day. Now with the security of the compound and his mates at his sides, he feels a sense of belonging and loyalty. As crew chief, he also feels responsible and has matured tenfold just within the last few days. Respected and well-liked, he intends to stay that way and is deeply pleased that Maddox is now the boss, with Darius as number two. He liked the boss man. They all did. But the boss man was never one of them. He was a rich, older white man, intent on making money from the young council estate kids, taking all the risks. He proved himself when the event happened and moved faster than anyone else, getting the compound secured and the kids safely inside. But still... Maddox was one of them, and he knew what they'd all been through, so it was better he was in charge. Jagger felt proud when Darius sought him out and asked him to lead a patrol out with instruction not to engage with anyone, no stopping and talking, no taxing survivors, just move round the estate and make sure nothing bad was going on anywhere and get back so they could carry on working. As they threaded their way out of the gates... Jagger and his small company moved quietly and quickly through the streets, stepping over and round the festering dead bodies decomposing in the sun. He had wondered why they hadn't cleared them away, but Maddox said the smell covered up the compound and made it harder for the infected to find them. That's why Maddox was in charge, because he thought of things like that. Jagger had already decided to volunteer his crew for the night's security, wanting the honour of going first, and when he mentioned it to his crew, they readily accepted. Now, in the oppressive heat of the scorching late afternoon sun, the crew started their patrol, moving down the main roads, checking the side streets and avenues, and stopping to listen at every junction. The chat and banter between them was muted and quiet, his crew well-trained and experienced at staying nimble and alert. As the afternoon wore on, so Jagger felt a growing sense of discomfort. Every street was empty, no infected anywhere, no survivors picking through the debris and litter or breaking into the houses. Nothing appeared to have changed either. It was quiet, too quiet, and his crew picked up on it too. Moving quietly and examining the streets with care, they found not a single infected anywhere. Speed up, we need to check the whole place, Jagger whispered to his crew, afraid of speaking loud in the deafening silence of the deserted estate. They did speed up, and moved faster at a jogging pace, street by street, suburb by suburb, checking the various sets of shops and lock-ups, but nothing anywhere. It was eerie and profound, and Jagger wanted nothing more than to head back to the compound and the laughing and joking with all his mates. As they entered a suburb previously allocated to Jagger and his crew, he moved them down to a house he knew was occupied by survivors. Standing outside, he stared hard at the house. The windows were boarded up, and the door had extra planks nailed across. No sign of life. He'd been told not to engage or speak to anyone, but Jagger felt something wasn't right. Something was up. He hesitated for a few minutes, but in the end chose to do as told instead of trying to speak to the people in the house. Walking away, he felt eyes staring at him from the house, but every time he turned back, there was nothing to see. Entering the compound, the gates already opened to welcome them in, and proving that the tower worked by Jagger and his crew being seen way down the street, Jagger was handed a bottle of water by Darius as the crew moved off to get drinks and find shade. Something ain't right, bruv. Jagger took a long swig and wiped the sweat from his head. There's nothing out there, you get me? Nothing. No infected, no survivors. The place is empty, bruv. You what? Darius asked. 
I'm telling you, bruv, there was no movement, no infected, no zombies, no survivors, nothing. The whole estate is empty. We went everywhere, all the way down to the beach. And the only thing we saw was some smoke, like, way out to sea, like a boat on fire or something, innit? A boat? Darius repeated, clearly confused. Yeah, like miles away in the sea, just some black smoke going up into the sky, innit? There ain't nothing else out there. So where are they all gone? Darius asked, more to himself. Don't know, but it freaked us all out, swear down. Yeah, get some rest, Jagger. I'll tell Maddox. Sweet, bruv. Darius moved off to find Maddox, but with a hundred plans trying to be implemented and not having felt the eeriness himself, something became lost in translation. By the time he found Maddox, in the unit talking to Lensky, he simply reported that Jagger had not seen anyone and no infected either. He did mention that Jagger was freaked out a little, but the conversation quickly moved on to sorting the houses out and getting clean bedding. If they should keep all of the cannabis plants or just some, if they should let the crews use their back gardens or not, and rearranging the tents in the compound. The emptiness of the estate, the lack of infected or survivors noted by Jagger, was hardly pressed upon. To the north, barely a few miles away and on the other side of the motorway bordering the estate, the hordes gather quietly. Hundreds and hundreds of undead, fetid, decaying, drooling, and all of them hungry. They mass in great numbers, held in place by the will of the super zombie holding his position on the unused motorway and staring with evil intent at the estate and the young, tender bodies held within. Looking up at the sky, the taxi-driving zombie feels the heat of the day, but knows the darkness is but a few hours away. Within the estate, survivors sharpen knives, tape blades to the end of sticks and make spears, find bats and ram nails through the ends, get bottles of white spirit and other flammable liquids, and stuff rags in the necks. They quietly busy themselves, preparing for the darkness and the fun it will bring. Some are in a state of nervous trepidation, others are excited, and a few are outright shitting themselves. But they all know that if they move together, if they fight together, they will take the compound and get the prize held within it. The drugs, the alcohol, the food, the safety. Then they will be the ones living in proper comfort, while those feral little shits are put back out on the streets where they belong. 12. Look at that! Lani points over at the back of the rib and out to sea, at the thick black smoke billowing from the ferry still drifting across the sea. That's a big smoke signal, I mutter quietly, reminded of Dave's concerns from earlier and suddenly realising how easily we can be spotted now. We move several miles down the coast, going away from Portsmouth and moving just a few hundred metres from the shoreline, watching for the fort. None of us know exactly where it is, but we know it is this direction. The shoreline changes from beautiful sandy beaches, rocky outcrops and manicured landscapes bordered by villages, fields and seaside businesses. Small harbours dotted here and there, some of them nothing more than a couple of pontoons with fishing boats tied alongside. The whole scene looks serene and comforting, safe even. Rural England at the seaside whitewashed cottages, brightly coloured wooden dinghies, shoreside pubs with tables and chairs scattered about, sun umbrellas advertising beers and soft drinks. The steady rumble of the outboard engine, the gentle breeze and the warmth of the day give me hope. Lani glancing at me every now and then, smiling and looking content. The whole thing gives me a sense of hope. Hope that there will be a future for mankind and that we can recover from this and maybe even make it better in the end. Green fields stretching away from the shore suddenly give way to houses. Lots of houses. A sprawling mess of a housing estate going back as far as the eye can see, and seemingly going on for miles. Even from here, the cheap, shitty state of the houses are easily spotted. The run-down feel of the place. Terraced and semi-detached houses built close together. It looks rough with items of furniture visible in front gardens. Satellite dishes hanging off walls, old paint and road poorly maintained. We all stare inland, watching as it slowly drifts by, 
and I know I'm thanking whatever powers that rule us that I wasn't in that estate when this thing went off. It would have been hell in such a built-up urban area, people living on top of each other in an already hardened state of life. My family are working class, not posh or wealthy in any respect, but thankfully we never lived on estates like that, and I've heard stories about how hard they can be, and the reality television programs that showed the lives of the twisted morals, the drug and alcohol abuse, the crime and violence. But like most people that never came from areas like that, I can't help but look down my nose at them, at the way they lived, the aggressive, overly defensive street language. Bloody hell, the end of the world, the zombie apocalypse is upon us, and I'm still sneering at the perceived rough common people. I'm not the only one either, judging by the comments of Chav City and Pikey Land being muttered from everyone else. Then the engine cuts out and we all turn to stare at Nick. Nick, who I have personally seen staring down hordes of zombies with a laughing glint in his eye, facing certain death with barely a tremor. A hardened killer, skilled fighter, tough lad with a skill for electrical and mechanical things. He swam after a ferry and scaled a rope just to stop it getting away. But right now, sitting behind the wheel of a rib, on a perfectly flat sea a few hundred metres from shore, and with the rest of us staring at him, he holds a look of horror on his face. Frozen in time, unmoving as the silence descends, and the only noise is the gentle lapping of the water from the front as the momentum of the boat pushes us along. Shit! Nick mutters in a high-pitched voice. Shit, shit, shit! Nick? Blowers ask softly, Shit, 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 shit! Nick repeats and grimaces as he twists the key and pushes the start button. Nick! Blowers growls now with an edge to his voice. I'm never fucking driving again! You lot can fuck off and drive yourselves from now on! Fucking boats cutting out and engines! Shit, shit, shit! Nick! Clarence's deep voice snaps his head up. It's okay, mate. Just calm down. Yeah, thanks. Nick sighs with a look of relief. And fix the bloody boat, Clarence adds, and the look of shock on Nick's face sets me off as I burst out laughing. Cookie and Blowers instantly join in, laughing with delight. Nick smiles sheepishly and sticks his fingers up as we clamber our way over to him. Don't worry, mate. Boats just aren't your thing, Blowers jokes. Or piers, Lani shouts over to a fresh outbreak of giggles. There'll be some paddles in here somewhere, Cookie says, looking about. Paddles? Are we on a hire boat on a canoe lake? Clarence grumbles. You mean oars? Same thing, Cookie scratches his head. Aren't they? We've got two, Lani holds two small oars up. What's wrong with it, Nick? I ask the poor lad sat looking dumbstruck on the centre seat with his head in his hands. No fuel, Mr Howie, he replies quietly. That's not your fault, mate. Any one of us could have checked that. Are we paddling along the coast or putting in here at Gangsterland? I think we'd better go in here, mate. Find a vehicle and go by road. It'll take hours to paddle along the coast with so many of us in this boat. Right, I'll take one on this side. Clarence takes one of the oars and straddles the rubber skirt. I'll do the other side. I reach out to take the oar from Lani, who stares at me with a look of mock defiance. I can paddle perfectly well, Mr Howie, she smiles to show she's joking, and straddles the skirt. Both of them start moving the paddles through the water, and within a couple of minutes, it's very clear this is going to be a long job. Two small paddles trying to push a big rib through the water with several adults, loads of guns, crates of ammunition and a bloody great big machine gun. We swap over with me and Cookie taking the next turn and then we keep swapping over, trying to paddle hard and making barely any discernible progress. Sweating freely, panting and drinking bottles of water, we lean down and use our hands in the water, frantically paddling and trying to reach the shore. It does get closer, but painfully slowly, and we all become acutely aware of the sun dropping down towards the horizon and the coming night. 
fucking stuck in Chavland in the middle of the night. We'll get mugged, I'm telling you. Cookie whines, looking up at the shore. Who's going to mug us? Blowers asks between ragged breaths. Those little chav gangster shits. They'll have more guns than us, Cookie replies. Swear down, bruv, Nick says. In it, blood, Lani says in a brilliant accent. Swear down my bling blood in it. Giggles burst out as she continues in a perfect movie accent of council estate speak. I was born on a council estate, Dave says, cutting through the laughter instantly. Really? I ask him, suspicious this might be one of his attempts at humour. Yes, Mr Howie. Where? Hang on, I think we're into the shallows, Clarence interrupts. He unclips his belt, handing the pistol and magazines to Lani, and drops over the side, landing chest deep to a low chorus of cheers. He ducks down and washes the sweat from his face as Dave leans over the front and hands him a rope which looks like a thin bit of string in his big mitts. Then he starts wading, and then we all feel the boat start to move faster. As we get closer, Nick and Tom drop over, taking the rope and pulling the boat in. Pull, my beauties. Pull me to the shore, my servants. Swear down in it, blood. Lani stands at the very front, her feet planted wide and her hands on her hips, looking down at the lads with a haughty expression. That sets us off again, and even Dave smiles at the sight of Lani the Queen ordering her subjects. She finds a length of rope, and taking care not to hit anyone, she whips the surface of the water and shouts demonically, Pull my ship! Pull it harder! Mwahaha! Laughing like bloody idiots, with Cookie physically bent over and crying at the sight, we gradually make it to the shore and jump down to help pull the boat up the pebble beach. Bloody look at that! Blowers shakes his head at the sight of the broken glass bottles, takeaway wrapping and litter strewn across the narrow beach. We need a vehicle. We can't carry that lot. I walk up the beach and onto the road, looking up and down for any signs of vehicles. Nothing in sight. With a sigh, I walk back, grimacing at the lengthening shadows and the onset of dusk. We can't split the group, and we don't want to leave that lot here, but then we can't carry it all either. Mr Howie, we could hide some of it in one of those buildings. Tom points across the road to the row of semi-detached houses. All of them look normal, undamaged and empty. Dump some stuff here and come back for it? Clarence nods in agreement, stripping his boots off and wringing his socks out. In this heat, it'll be dry in no time. Dave? I ask, looking at Dave, examining the houses. It's the best option, but we need to move fast, otherwise anyone watching us land here will know we delayed for something. Okay, you go and clear one of the houses and we'll bring the stuff over. On it, Dave answers and jogs over the road, picking a middle house that looks as average as the others. He disappears round the back, and less than a minute later, the front door opens and he nods for us to come over. Carrying the crates, boxes and spare rifles, we do shuttle runs across the road, securing the load into an upstairs room. We ditch our shotguns too, but keep the axes and knives. Then, armed with assault rifles, we gather back outside while Dave locks the front door from the inside and scoots out the back. Bloody hell, Clarence, you carrying that? I turn round to see Clarence stood there holding the GPMG by the top handle, loops of ammunition belts gathered round his neck and making him look even more mercenary than before. I always used to carry one of these back in the day. Clarence lifted the gun with ease and showed the end of the ammunition belt already fed into the side of the weapon. Malcolm and Chris always took the piss, but it got us out of some tight spots. Yeah, I can imagine, I reply as Dave joins us. Then we're back. Our group, on foot, and armed to the teeth. I did consider waiting the night out in the house, but I know we all want to get back to the fort. Night is here, Tom says, looking at the black sky and the stars shining down. No howling, Blowers cocks his head to listen. We all do the same, straining, but there is virtually no noise other than the sounds caused by our presence. Let's move out, find a vehicle... Get back here and get our stuff, then back to the fort. Stay quiet and keep your eyes and ears open. Dave up front, 
Clarence at the rear. Okay, let's go. 13. The Earth spins on its axis as the rays from the sun sweep across the surface. Night becomes dawn, but here on a motorway in the south of England, day becomes night. A quickening takes place and the ex-taxi driving zombie feels his heart soar as the last of the golden rays plunge below the horizon. As one, the massed gathering lift their faces and howl into the air, guttural roars that fill the sky and they change instantly from the stumbling, shambling, slow-moving things of the day into the evil terrors of the night. Heads become fixed. Eyes focus and limbs twitch less. Steps become easier and controlled and then the exodus starts. Pouring from the embankment, they drop down onto the tarmac of the road, gathering round the super zombie, growling and whining with impatience. He waits until most of them are down and then sets off, using the moonlight to pick his way through across the road, over the central reservation, across the other lane and down the embankments into the thin fields that border the estate, and then they pass through into the urban squalor. Hordes and hordes of zombies pouring into the streets and keeping pace with the intelligent face of the super-zombie pacing at the front. The ex-taxi driver has perfect knowledge of the road layout and knows exactly where to go. Straight down through the estate, and then up the main road that leads to the compound, an all-out frontal charge that will overwhelm the tender pieces of meat within the high fences. His own mouth fills with drool at the pressing urge to feed. Saliva spools down his shirt as he quickens his pace. 14. Are we all here? Jeff whispers loudly into the dark shadows of the library. Moonlight and fag ends glinting off the metal nails sticking out of bats and sticks. The medley of weaponry staggered him at first and his face split into a grin at the sight of the savage bastards tooled up and ready for Armageddon. OK, now listen. Everyone that lives to the east of the centre will attack from that side. Everyone that lives west will go from this side. We go up the two side streets and meet at the middle. Which way is east? Am I from east or west? Is that left or right, Jeff? Fuck. OK. If you live the other side of the compound, then loop round and come in from your side. Those of us that live this side will come in from this side. Why are we doing that, Jeff? If we go straight up the middle road, they'll see us miles off. And in the dark, with two big groups coming at them, they'll think we've got even bigger numbers and might give up easier. Or fight harder, a voice calls out to a reply of shh from various people. So we give it half hour, then go for it. That gives you plenty of time to loop round, got it? Can we throw our Molotov cocktails? Someone whispers. Don't be so bloody stupid, you'll burn all the plants down, someone replies. Oh, OK, maybe just at the gates then. No, no firebombs. None at all? No. Well, that's not fair. Hang on, Jeff whispers frantically, trying to prevent an all-out argument from erupting. Take them with you. If we need them, we'll call for them. Got it? What, like in the movies, what are you going to yell? Mortars? Uh, y yeah, we'll yell mortars, Jeff says, exasperated. OK. Thanks, Jeff. That's OK, Rodney. Now, everyone ready? Yes? Good. And don't forget that nasty bastard Maddox or whatever his name is. Make sure someone gets him quickly. Right. Let's go. 15. OK, OK. Maddox waves his arms to settle the crowds of youths gathered round the roaring fire in the pit. Now that has been a long day. A very long day and we've everything done that we set out to achieve. He stands tall and proud. Proud of the tired faces looking up at him. In the course of one day, they have gone from being dope-smoking faces hiding in hoods to normal, fresh-faced youngsters. 
flushed from a day's physical exertion and effort. Maddox made them eat good food too. Tinned vegetables, rice and tinned meat, and washed down with plenty of fresh water. I'm proud of you guys. I know we all come from the streets and we talk like gangsters, in it, bruv? And everyone hated us. We were the pests of the estate. We were the shit that blighted everyone's lives. The schools rejected us. Our families rejected us. But we had each other. We stood by each other during the bad times and now look at us. We're the ones in a safe place with loads of food while everyone else is shitting themselves. We went out there and killed those things. Us. Children and youths went out and took down the infected and made sure our streets were safe. Now we have a bigger compound with high fences, weapons, a guard tower, houses, food, water, and we have each other. Maddox's voice carries strong across the rear of the compound, and even cynical, hardened youths like Darius and Mohammed are stirred by his words. Jagger is taking first watch tonight. He volunteered for it. In fact, all the crews volunteered for the first overnight watch. And you know what that tells me? That tells me we got each other's backs. We ain't the little gangster shits they all think we are. We're the future. We got community right here and we made it. And we're going to keep it. We're going to make it bigger and safer. We're going to take this area back and show everyone that if they want to live in our yard, they do it under our rules. No more religion. No more racism. No more stereotypes and thinking we're as thick because we speak different. This is our time now. And we're going to make the rules from now on. Cheering erupts as the children and youths feel filled with pride. Through their own hard work and dedication, they've shown what can be achieved. We gotta cut back on the weed, Maddox continued. Every now and then is cool, but too much fucks you up like Riker and the boss man. That is not cool, you get me? We're gonna be fit and healthy, fighters and warriors. How can we protect each other if we're stoned and doped up? Also, we ain't going to kill the survivors for not paying no more. We defend ourselves at whatever cost. And if that means we have to kill to defend what's ours, then that's okay. But those people out there are frightened, just like we were. They're scared and don't know nothing. They ain't hard or tough like we are. They can't figure out how to get food either. So we're going to protect them. And in return, they can supply goods for us. Food, clothing, whatever they got that they want to share. If they need help and we can help them, then we will. we got to set the rules from now on. If we kill them, then they will want to kill us, and that puts us all in a constant state of war. Maddox pressed the point home, remembering the lessons the boss man taught him. The next couple of days we'll get the houses rigged up, and you can move into them. But we also got to plant food and crops for the winter, so that means digging the ground up and stuff. I don't know how we do that, so we might have to go to the library and find a book, unless anyone can get Google working. A few laughs break out. We got plans, and we'll do this together. I got your backs, and you got mine, right? A few murmurs, and Maddox shook his head theatrically. I said I got your backs, so you got mine, right? Louder response this time, voices shouting out and caught in the moment. The atmosphere of camaraderie bursting through them, the campfire, the hard work done by all, the good food and the warm weather, all combined to make them feel safe, wanted and secure. Right, it's late. Chill out and relax. We'll get a generator on the monitors and Xboxes for a few games. You've earned that, but no weed and no booze tonight, you get me? A chorus of replies, excited about the prospect of playing games but most of them too exhausted to want to do anything other than fall asleep. Jagger, you got the watch, bruv. Maddox looked over to the crew chief, stood off to one side with his crew stood around him. All of them trying to affect an air of detached toughness, aloof and ready for action, armed with shotguns and rifles. On it, Jagger replied and headed away with his crew. He led them to the front gates and sent two up the tower, then one into each end house to watch the side roads, one more on the ground at the base of the tower, and the rest doing foot patrols around the perimeter. All of them under strict instruction not to start playing games or get talking to the other kids for too long. Keep moving and keep vigilant. The only thing missing was a spotlight on the tower, 
still to be organised and rigged up by Maddox and Darius. That was good speech, Lenski said softly as they walked back into the units. As soon as they entered the dark shadows, they stopped and kissed passionately for a few seconds before breaking away and giggling as they checked to make sure no one had seen them. Thanks, Maddox replied after a few seconds of kissing. It is all good now, so much better. I am proud of you, Lenski murmured. Thanks, that means a lot. And it did. Maddox knew he was doing a good job and knew he had the respect and the love from the youths to get them to what he wanted, but it had been hard-earned and came with a cost. Thinking to the deaths of the boss man, Zayden and Riker, he knew it was the way it panned out. Events that he probably had no control over, and if it wasn't for those awful things, then this would never be happening. So is the king ready for bed yet? Lenski smiled and ran her hands over his shoulders and down his arms. Yeah, he is. How about the queen? Is she ready? I don't know this. I find Scala and ask her, Lenski giggled. Scala, Maddox scoffed quietly. I need a real woman. You think I am the real woman, yes? Oh, yes. Taking her hand, he leads her through the darkened units towards his room and once inside with the door closed, the kissing continues, gentle at first and building up to a passionate, frantic embrace with a sense of urgency propelling them both to strip off and fall onto the bed. Moonlight pours through the small, grimy window, illuminating the room with just enough light for them to vaguely see the outline of the furniture, but tantalisingly dark so that touch becomes the dominant sense. You're right, bruv. Jagger asks the youth staring out the window down the side street. Having already checked the guard on the other side, and the two in the tower, he now checks on this one before moving off into the compound. Yes, yeah, sweet Jagger, the kid answers, his shotgun resting against the wall and a small gas lantern turned low at his feet. You got the radio. Call me if you need anything or start falling asleep, you get me? Swear down I will, Jagger, he grins enthusiastically. Nice one. Jagger quietly slips out, leaving the 11-year-old boy staring out the window, his small hands drumming a beat on the windowsill as he glances over and nods at the two kids on the tower. Like most of the youths, he feels no great sense of loss from the infection taking his family, and being here with everyone else is more of a family than he's ever known. He's getting fed, given water and nice things to drink, and he's got a nice bed to sleep in. Humming a tune to himself, he drums his hands and lets his mind wander off, staring at the road stretching away opposite him, but not really seeing. No streetlights or illumination other than the natural moonlight. Deep shadows blend into deeper silhouettes, building lines become muddled with garden walls. The end of the pavement is blurred and indistinct. Stare at anything for too long, and it takes on a form of its own, creating horrors within the imagination. Minutes pass as he sips from a can of Red Bull, specially preserved for the night security crews. The syrupy taste is nice and he wants to gulp it down, but he knows he'll then have nothing to do. So he sips it gingerly and places it back down on the ground between his feet, then lifts it up and puts it on the windowsill. Turning the can round so the front is facing him, then away, then front again. He adjusts the position of the lamp a few times, then practices reaching for the shotgun. He moves his seat round a little, making small adjustments so that he can reach it with ease, but moving the seat has warped the symmetry of the lamp and the can of Red Bull, so he sets about adjusting them so they are just right. Finally, and with a contented sigh of satisfaction, he looks up and scans the view. His mouth drops open, and his heart rate, despite the near-toxic ingredients of the energy drink, goes from sedate to panic within a split second. Adrenaline purges through his system and his hands shake as he scrabbles for the radio, knocking the can over and kicking the lantern away, which instantly puffs out. Cursing and fumbling in the dark, he gropes round for the radio. Unable to find it, he looks back up and realises that there is no time to waste. He leans out of the window, draws a deep breath and screams one word into the night. CONTACT! 16. 
The horde staggers through the estate, a demanding pressure building up as the undead growl at the steady pace they're held at. The need to eat, to feast, to find flesh burns through them and consumes their every ounce of being, but the zombie wants them together. He wants a combined attack and the energy levels as high as possible. The concentrated pack sweep down street after street and every jerky step brings them closer to the goal. Minutes pass as they navigate the now deserted estate. The decomposing bodies left on the ground are trampled by hundreds and hundreds of feet, pummeling the squidgy bodies into a pulp. Bare zombie feet get sliced and cut from sharp fragments of broken glass. Blood seeps out only to clot and congeal faster than human blood. These bodies are already so more advanced than the human form, having gone days without food or water, drawing off the reserves within their own forms, sucking the nutrients from organs and pumping them round. Any sense of pain is gone. No remorse, no emotions, no feeling other than a burning desire to eat flesh. That's all that drives them. Vivid images of juicy, tender meat being bitten into flash through their rotten minds. Chemicals pumped into their bloodstream build their energy levels up. The dead hearts beat faster and harder. The eyes roll and twitch as they seek food. The ability to smell becomes heightened as they sniff the air in front of them, searching for the smell of fear, the smell of shit, the smell of piss, the smell of anything that means humans are near. The horde pour round a long corner and start up a slight incline towards the compound. One long straight road now, and they'll be there. That fence will fall with the combined weight of so many bodies slamming into it. They might shoot and fire their measly weapons, but the taxi super zombie knows he will win the day, and before the night is out, his hosts shall feast. 17. Jeff, after waiting for half an hour and feeling his patience wearing thin, listening to the inane and absurd chatter of his fellow estatees, finally checks his watch and stares at the second hand, willing it to move round to the twelve. Desperate to be off and moving, but knowing they stand no chance without both groups converging at the same time. Yeah, so I said to our Millie, she got to stand by him. He's doing a stretch and that's hardly his fault, is it? He's doing the best he can, bless him. And Millie, she got to wait. Of course, she got the baby now and I know she ain't sure who the baby father is. He don't know that, but his dad got a BMW and she ain't going to find no other boys with dads that got BMWs, so she got to wait. And it went on. Aimless and pointless talking, wasting perfectly good air. That got Jeff thinking of what's happened to the prisons. Surely they must be safe. Big walls, strong fences, plenty of food and tough men. No one allowed in or out. That would be bloody ironic if the only survivors were the inmates of the world. What if they broke out now? Hundreds of hard men rampaging through the countryside, raping and pillaging everything and everyone in sight. That's why he needs this compound now, the security for when the inmates all break out. In his mind, all the inmates are the denim trousers and white vest-wearing prisoners of the American movies. Muscles on muscles, huge arms and shoulders, swastikas and random numbers inked into the shaven skulls. With a shudder, he checks his watch and whimpers with desperation as the second hand ticks slowly round. He taps his foot, smokes a cigarette, taps the stave against his leg, stares at the night sky, takes his knife out from his belt and puts it back in again. Then, after leaving it for what feels like hours, he checks the watch and nods with satisfaction. The time is here. The time for action. Let's go. No talking now. We need absolute quiet until I say, then we charge like mad. Got it? Faces shining from the moonlight all nod at him. He turns and leads the way, pacing steadily and feeling the adrenaline purging into his system. Legs feeling a bit shaky and his hand holding the wooden stave trembles so he brings it across his body and pats it up and down in his spare hand. Estate survivors stretched out behind him. He turns and ushers them to move up and stay close together, rolling his eyes as clubs get dropped and the nails sticking out of bats dig into other people's legs, causing remarks of complaint. They move up the street and turn onto the main road that cuts across the front of the compound. Jeff knows that if this is timed right, he will see the other half of the survivors at the junction. 
If there is a guard positioned there still, then that guard will shout down that there are two large bodies of people coming in from different directions. Smiling with anticipation, but also feeling scared, he wills himself to keep going and lead these idiots. Once the two sides meet and charge at the fence, he can drop back in the chaos and stay safe somewhere deep in the ranks, or maybe even dart into one of the houses and wait it out to charge out triumphantly later when the nasty fighting has been done. That little shit Maddox should never have punched him like that. The little punk gangster with those hard, intelligent eyes, that deep voice and aura of power. Who the fuck does he think he is? 18. CONTACT! The boy and girl on the top of the tower spin round in alarm at the lad leaning out the window on the right and pointing down the side street. Hearts hammering, they lean over, desperate to see what's coming. CONTACT! The girl in the window on the left screams out. Her high-pitched voice send their stomachs plummeting. Contact from both side streets at the same time? What's going on? Oh my fucking god, Daryl! The girl lifts her hand to her mouth and points with a shaking arm down the road ahead of them. In the dark shadows, a solid mass of staggering forms slowly comes into view. The distance and gloom too great to see the faces. But just from the jerky movements, the almost goose-step walk, the swagger of the upper torso. Infected. Hundreds of infected. Contact on all sides! Daryl roars into his radio, then realises he hasn't pressed the button down. His shaking hands fumble and press it down as he repeats the word. Contact on all sides! Contact on all sides! Fuck this, the girl mutters and lifts her rifle, pointing it vaguely in the direction of the army of infected and pulling the trigger. The loud retort bounces round the buildings. The first shot. The first bullet spins through the air and hits nothing but falls gently to the ground far in the distance. The gunshot sends a signal to all three sides. This is happening now. The element of surprise is gone. Charge. Make noise and charge. They do. Jeff with his half, the other half coming from the opposite direction and the army of infected. They all roar and they all charge. 19. Contact on all sides! Contact on all sides! The radio, clipped to the side of Maddox's trousers lying in a crumpled heap on the floor, bursts to life. A gunshot rings out, the unmistakable sound of a rifle shot. With pure instinct flooding through his body, he rolls from the bed, grabs his trousers and starts dressing with lightning speed. Lenski's heart races as she fumbles around, finding her clothes and cursing quietly in Polish. Everyone to the front! Maddox speaks calmly, firmly into the radio. Get weapons, get ready, and get to the front. Don't wait for me! What is it? Lenski asks. Don't know. Maddox pulls his boots on and grabs the pistol from the cupboard top, pulling the slide back and checking the ammunition clip as he moves quickly towards the door. Get somewhere safe, Maddox shouts behind him and runs through the units and out into the humid night air. Gunshots sounding out from the gate, roars and shouts of rage already reaching him as he races towards the gate. What is it? Maddox shouts at Jagger, already on the top of the tower and taking shots with his rifle. All sides, Maddox! Three groups! Infected and survivors! Fucking chaos! What the fuck? Maddox replies in shock. He grabs the first scaffold bar and pulls himself up the tower with ease. Reaching the top and staring out, the hardened man's mouth drops open in shock at the sight. The road ahead is thick with infected, pressing forward towards the compound. The road on the right is thick with estate survivors coming towards the compound. The road on the left is the same, survivors tooled up and charging at the gates. He takes it all in within a split second. The left and right have planned a coordinated attack, planning to meet at this time to attack and take the compound. The infected are charging from the road opposite, also intent on taking the compound. They don't know about each other. The two groups of survivors are screaming as they charge, weapons held high as they sprint. Looks of confusion as they see the third group emerging from the central road. Who are they? 
Has Jeff got another group with us? No, they're infected. Maddox watches with horror as the three armies commit themselves. The ones at the front couldn't stop if they wanted due to the momentum of the people behind them. The last few seconds seem to slow down as everyone realises what's about to happen. Even the zombies look confused for a second. They emerge into the open junction, keeping the shape of the road they came from. Then, seeing the two groups of humans on both sides, they do a literal double take. A zombie in the lead wearing a white shirt, tie and name badge shakes his head in confusion, then smiles. The smile spreads into a grin as he howls. The howls are taken up by every other infected. The three sides meet in a devastating clash of utter terror. The estate survivors at the back, having no idea of the army of infected and hearing the start of the battle and being desperate to join in, all push forward and force the centre to become bogged with scrapping bodies. The rear columns of zombies, all hearing the battle and all needing to feast, push forward and drive their undead bodies into the melee. Maddox shakes his head slowly. He raises his pistol to fire, then slowly lowers it again. He cocks his head to one side, lifting the pistol again and sweeping it over the battling masses below him. Who are we shooting? Jagger asks him. Maddox turns to see the entire camp stretched out behind him, bodies leaning out of windows of the houses and staring into the muddle-massed battle. The cries of rage, terror, hurt, pain and glory ripping the air apart mere feet from them. Fuck this! Shoot everything! Maddox roars out and opens fire with his pistol. Guns blaze out from all sides, behind the gates shooting through the gaps. Muzzles flash and rounds pour into the mass of bodies. Shoot everything! Maddox screams again, his eyes ablaze. 20. Yeah, but I really didn't expect there to be no vehicles anywhere, I reply, wiping the sweat from my face and sighing. This is a council estate, Lani continues. They would have used them all to get away, or stolen them, or burnt them out. Yeah, I guess. I glance about at the run-down houses on either side. We've spent the last half hour stalking through street after street, searching for a vehicle, heading further into the estate. The long, straight roads, the potted road surface, houses with peeling facades and windows grimy long before the outbreak started. We freeze and drop down, raising weapons to our shoulders at the signal from Dave, freezing on the spot and holding one arm up with a clenched fist. To their credit, Lani and Tom respond just as quickly as the rest of us, having been given instruction by Clarence while on the Navy supply ship. Dave opens his fist then closes it again, repeating it several times and waving forward. Multiple contacts ahead. Dave glances round, and I shake my head at him. Can't hear anything, mate, I whisper across. Dave glances across the line at the rest all shaking their heads. Something happening, Dave cocks his head. Not sure what, though. Keep going, I whisper back, and we start off moving stealthily behind Dave, weapons at the ready, fingers extended over trigger guards. Dave reaches the junction at the end of the road before us and instantly drops down to a crouch, lifting his rifle to his shoulder and aiming down to the right. Scatter, I whisper. We crab across the road into the deep shadows on the sides and watch Dave as he stares down along the wider main road on his right. Dave lifts his hand and motions for me to come forward. I step out, keeping low, and creep over towards him. As I gain the junction, Dave motions down the road and I peer down to see the solid ranks of undead staggering away from us. Stretched fully across the road and taking every available inch, crammed and densely packed, they rush forward, clearly intent on getting to something ahead of them. I can smell them now. The stench of death. Decomposition, decay, rotten flesh from the hundreds of walking stiffs that must have staggered past this junction just minutes before. I motion for the others to move up and wait while they shuffle forward and gather round us, all staring down at the backs of the undead, down the road to the right. A single gunshot rings out, followed immediately by the distinct sound of undead howling with an attack. 
More voices, human voices that roar out and mingle with the undead roars, screams and shouts. We look down the road and at each other, wondering what the hell we've bumbled into this time. The howls and screams bounce and echo off the buildings, the sound funneling down the streets and coming at us from many directions. A single loud voice bellows out. A deep male voice, then shots. Many shots. Rifles, Clarence mutters. And shotguns, Dave adds, his head still cocked over and listening intently. That lot are going at someone, Blowers says. They are, I reply, staring at the back of the massed horde. The dirty fuckers are attacking someone. My voice comes out in a low growl as I feel the anger start to rise. We got an advantage for once, Nick says, clicking his safety off. Yeah, I stand up. We all stand up. I copy Nick and flick my safety off and check my belt for the pouches of spare magazines. Are we attacking them? Tom asks. We all stare at him, with the glint in his eye, but the desire and hunger we can see within him. Lani holds it too, a familiar grimace we've all come to know from so many battles together. Yeah, I reply. We are. Spread out and form a line. Clarence, can you fire that thing on the move? Yes, boss, he answers, as he hefts the weapon to waist height and holds the ammunition belt with one hand, ready to feed it in. Clarence in the middle, then. We hold the line and keep a steady pace. I step out and sense the others spreading out in a line. Like slow motion, we stride across the blackened streets, hearts beating, mouths dry, eyes staring hard. This isn't our fight. We have no idea what's going on, but here there are undead. Hundreds of undead and they're attacking something. People are firing back at them, which means there are humans. That makes it our business right there. No one invited us to this fight, but we're here and we've slaughtered more of your kind than you will ever know. You have no idea what's behind you. Six outright nasty bastards. One giant and one truly psychotic killer. Seven assault rifles and one big fucking machine gun. Seven men and one girl. Eight of us. Eight that stalk you. Eight that will kill you. Dave? Yes, Mr. Howie? You ready, Dave? Yes, Mr. Howie. Let them know we're here, Dave. We come to a stop and pause while Dave sucks a deep lungful of air in. I smile and glance left and right. We're all smiling. We know what's coming. We are here to kill you! Dave's voice penetrates every sound, drowning everything else out. His bellow simply stops everything in its track. 21. What the fuck was that? Maddox screamed while quickly ejecting the shells from his shotgun and pushing two more in. The intense close quarter fighting has spilled across the junction as zombies and survivors fight, bite and die with utter savageness. The bodies smash into the gates as undead attack the fences and survivors frantically plead to open up and save them. As survivors get bit, they drop, then come back a few minutes later. Maddox and his youths pour fire into them, but for every kill they get, be it human or infected, more pour in. The gates weaken and rattle with each blow as more heavy bodies slam into them. Rifles and shotguns fire, expending ammunition, and Maddox knows that within a few minutes, they'll be out of shells and bullets, just as he was about to give the order to pull back and try and get over the walls at the back of the compound, a voice bellows out. The power and energy from it instantly ceases all action. Everything stops. Freezes. We are here to kill you. Howie is upon you and he brings death. Turn and face us. Turn and see the face of Howie. Who the fuck is Howie? Jagger whispers quietly. I don't know, but I hope he's got a big fucking gun, Maddox replies. 22. We are here to kill you. Howie is upon you, and he brings death. Turn and face us. Turn and see the face of Howie. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up. My breathing becomes faster, and my heart beats faster. 
The wonder drug of adrenaline floods my system. I will talk to Dave later about his choice of taunting words, but for now, for now there is us and you. They turn quickly as Dave's voice staggers everything in sight and hearing, the challenge given, the gauntlet laid. We hold our thin, measly line, fingers pressing lightly on triggers as we face down another army of undead. They start to stagger, faster, quicker, charging. They roar and howl at the sight of the bodies standing calmly and waiting for them. I hold for another few seconds, just long enough to let them get a few feet away from whatever they're attacking. Down! I shout, and as one, we drop down to the crouch. Magazines get placed quickly on the ground in front of us. They charge. They run now, gathering speed. Have it! My voice roars out and is cut off as seven assault rifles spew lead at them. Fingers squeeze triggers, muzzles flash, rounds spin, and zombies die. They fall and die as we fire into their ranks. Clarence pauses for a second as we empty our first magazines. The timing is perfect, and almost as one we shout, Magazine! as we eject the empty one and snatch a new one up. A quick memory of the Battle of Salisbury Plain flashes through my mind. My turn. Clarence stands and roars, letting rip with the GPMG held one-handed and firing into the zombies. We pause and stare in awe as the huge man absorbs the recoil into his massive frame and laughs with maniacal delight. One hand held out to the side, feeding the coil of ammunition belt into the side of the machine gun. He takes steady sweeps side to side and nothing survives the sheer firepower of the devastating weapon. Bodies burst apart, limbs sheared off, stomachs ripped out, skulls explode as they fall. Fire! I scream out as Clarence stops, and the small arms fire of the SA-80 assault rifles take up the work. They are nowhere near as powerful as the GPMG, but there are seven of them firing at once, and that more than makes up the difference. Advance! I shout as we change magazines and Clarence fires for a few seconds, taking big strides forward and sweeping the weapon left to right. There are hundreds and hundreds of them, and they keep coming turning and charging, and I had no idea how deeply packed they were or how far down the street they were stretched. They die in droves, sent back to the hell they crawled out from. Glancing over at Lani, I see her face alive with the glory of battle, the grime from the weapons smearing her face, and at this time, at this place, I realise I'm in love. As if touched by an invisible hand, she glances at me and smiles a gorgeous big grin full of white teeth. Once again, there is nowhere else I would rather be right now. 23. Get down and brace the gates, Maddox screams out, ordering his youths to lie down on the ground. The experience of knowing that bullets can fly for miles, especially when they're fired from assault rifles and heavy machine guns, with no idea who the new group of attackers are, but with a suspicion that maybe they're not here to attack the compound too, Maddox stares down at the junction in front of the gates and the terrific battle still being waged. More bodies slam into the gates, and he looks down to see his youth stacked up against the inside, holding low but pushing their bodies against them. The two groups from the side road still pour into the middle, roaring and screaming as they fight to join the battle, having no idea of the slaughter taking place just yards in front of them. The undead easily overpower the survivors, tearing them apart with a frenzied and sustained attack, biting and ripping flesh open, transmitting the deadly infection into the bloodstream and launching off to take more down. The zombies fight and claw their way into the ranks of the survivors, the darkness of the night and the confusion of the battle masking their roots. Legs, arms, stomachs and arses get bit. Survivors fall and die, writhing in agony for seconds before dying. Inside their bodies, the infection pours through every cell and brings them back, restarting the heart and bringing the host back in the new perfect form. The survivors twitch and sit up opening red bloodshot eyes and howling out as they launch and surge into the ranks of humans. The firing continues. Small arms from machine guns, then a heavy machine gun for a few seconds. Maddox strains his eyes and can just make out the muzzle flashes in the distance of the road ahead. 
Darius, get the weapons up into the windows and fire down. Keep firing everything we got. Jagger, get everyone else tooled up with hand weapons, anything they want. Maddox turns back to the front, watching the battle and knowing the estate survivors are fucked. They don't stand a chance. The infected are too fast and too powerful for them. Watching between the distant muzzle flashes and the battle underneath him, he senses that instead of running away, they may need to fight. If they run now, they'll always be running. Sometimes, Maddox, sometimes you can run away, retreat or withdraw and survive to fight another day. Every once in a while, though, son, you have to man up and stand your ground. Stand and fight, son. Whatever the outcome, whatever the cost, let them know your name and what you stand for. Be beholden to no man. Stand and fight, son. The boss man's words sound through his mind, the great and powerful lord brought down by smoking a plant. But he was right, and this is that time. 24. Magazine! I shout and eject the old one, quickly pushing it into the pouch on my belt and slamming a new one in. We've advanced enough to be reaching the first bodies felled by our bullets, but still they come, and still we mow them down, holding at times then advancing a couple of steps, but all the time taking ground and dispatching these foul things back to hell. Lucky bastards is what we are, finding such a big horde to play with, and at the point of being tooled up to high heaven too. New guns with lots and lots of shiny bullets to throw at them. Clarence is clearly having a great time doing his whole Rambo thing. I'm going to get him a bandana for his bald head and smear some black lines across his nose. Our incessant fire rate whittles them down and the bodies pile up. As with many times before, I notice that the bodies act as trip hazards and obstacles to the oncoming zombies, and a couple of times I smile at the sight of the stupid things tripping and falling over. Hold! Dave shouts out, and we drop down while he works to clear a blockage in his weapon. Clarence lays down flat and uses the front tripod to steady the weapon as he fires into the pressed ranks. The obliteration is immense, and before long we've got a nice big gap in front of us. Cleared! Dave shouts, and we rise up to advance again, marking our steps and holding the line. I notice some of our lads have switched to single shots and are going for headshots, calling out when they get one. Dave joins in, but again, he gets discounted as every one of his shots is a headshot. We're all getting better though, and we're getting more heads now than we were before. Apart from Lani and Tom, who are still quite new to the assault rifle experience. Picking them off one by one and letting Clarence do a sweep every couple of minutes with the GPMG, we conserve ammunition and make steady progress, and before long, we're looking through the pressed ranks at some kind of high fencing and a scaffold tower erected behind it. A fortified commune. This must be what the undead were attacking. From this distance, I can just make out a single figure stood on the top of the tower. I raise my hand and wave, hoping he can see us and be reassured that we're making headway towards them. He waves back just as muzzle flashes and shots ring out from the windows of houses behind the fence, shotguns and rifles firing down into the junction beneath them. Dave, shout for them to hold their fire, I shout, worried that they will fire into us if we keep advancing. Hold your fire! Let us work our way to you! Dave bellows out, and I can vaguely see as the man on the tower waves his arms, and after a couple of seconds, the shotguns and rifles cease. Move up, I shout, and we advance, firing into the undead as they still turn and charge at us. There is a ferocious battle taking place ahead of us, but the gates to that commune look closed and secure. So who is fighting outside the gates? People in the middle, Lani shouts. There are people in the junction, she adds. We peer down and look in horror at the men and women fighting out with sticks, battling away at the undead and being taken down by the ferocious attacks. We'll shoot them if we keep firing, Blower shouts, then aims and fires into a zombie breaking away to charge at us. Dave, get their attention. Tell them to pull back into the side streets. Move back. Move away from the junction. We will fire on you. Move away now. Dave bellows, but despite his enormous voice, 
he has little effect as the fighting is too intense for anyone to try and back away or turn to flee. What now? Tom asks in alarm at seeing more people being savaged down. We go in with hand weapons. I draw my axe wedged into the gap between my back and my rucksack, then twist the assault rifle round out of the way. Form a circle, we stay tight and fight to the gates, maybe draw the zombies away from the other survivors and give them a chance to get away. No arguments, and they can all see the sense in the planning. Clarence pushes the heavy machine gun to rest behind him on the long shoulder strap and pulls his axe out. We form up in a circle with Dave at the front and start advancing down towards the open junction. Within a few steps, we get contacts as the undead see us pushing out into the open ground and start charging. Axes swing as we cut and strike them down. Our close phalanx stays tight as we lash out, swiping and lunging. Lani making neat swipes with her meat cleaver and Dave just killing anything that looks at him the wrong way. This is carnage, I shout at the sight of many small fights taking place. People pressed against the gates, lashing out with sticks and bats with nails through the ends. The two roads leading away to the left and right are packed with bodies fighting and rolling about on the ground. Too dark and too confusing to see if they're undead or people. Open the gate, I shout up and wave at the man on top of the tower. He hesitates and sweeps his arms round at the junction, clearly telling me he's worried about breaching his own entry point. We'll keep it safe. Open the gate. They won't get in. They might, the man shouts down in a deep but youthful voice. Why are you in there if your people are out here fighting? They ain't my people. They came to attack us and take our compound. Those infected came at the same time, he shouts back. Shit, that was bad timing, Cookie jokes to a few sniggers from everyone else. How many have you got in there? 25 Maddox stares down at the fighting, still raging in the junction and watching the small group of mercenaries stalking down the road, slaughtering everything in their path. He watches as they get close to the junction, and then one of them shouts for him to cease fire. Stop shooting! Maddox waves his arms and hears his order repeated as the rifles and shotguns suddenly stop. Incredibly, the mercenaries then push their guns away and take bloody big axes out and get into a small circle before walking out into the junction. Maddox watches with keen interest his heart in his mouth as he observes the strange mix of people killing everything that steps close to them. A small man with two knives at the front, a giant man with a bald head, a tie girl, some young lads and a bloke with curly dark hair. How the fuck, he mutters to himself as the infected seem to drop instantly at the tight little swings and lunges these people lash out. The man with the curly dark hair shouts up to open the gates. Maddox refuses, pointing to the fierce fighting still taking place. He shouts down that these ain't his people, and someone says something funny within the circle as they all snigger. How many you got in there? the man shouts up. Maddox hesitates. If he tells them they're just children, it will show them as weak, and they're heavily armed with machine guns and assault rifles, and they look like soldiers. They are just children in here, Lenski shouts as she scrambles to the top of the tower to stand next to Maddox. Kids? Just kids? The man with the curly dark hair asks. Yeah, just kids, Maddox shouts back as Lenski grips his hand in terror at the sight of the carnage taking place. How many? The man asks. Over 100, Lenski shouts down in reply and Maddox watches as every face in that circle glances up. Hard looks on tough faces. Stay there and keep that gate closed. We'll sort this lot out. The man with the curly dark hair shouts. He says something to the rest of his group, and they instantly push their axes and knives away and pull their guns back around. At another order, they split into two lines of four standing back to back. They raise their weapons to their shoulders. Get down! Get down! Get down! Drop to the ground now! Drop to the ground now! 
the small man roars out and Maddox leans over to see people dropping down and covering their faces. The small group pauses a few seconds, then opens up, the hammering retorts booming out as the infected get shot to pieces. The heavy machine gun rips them apart like hot knives through butter, and within a few seconds, it's over. Everything that was standing is now dead. 26. We didn't hesitate when the woman said it was just kids inside, and we knew this had to end now. Why these adults were attacking a compound was beyond me, but that didn't matter. What mattered was ending this. So we did. Ruthlessly. Anything left standing after Dave gave the warning was shot down. We poured rounds into those things, and I have no doubt in my mind that we killed people too. But the way it was going, they would have been bitten and turned anyway. So they had it coming. There were so many undead in amongst them, we could never have ended it cleanly. This wasn't our fight, and maybe we had no right to get involved. But I know if I was behind a high fence with over a hundred children, I'd want someone to come and kill the nasty monsters for me. As the smoke cleared, we ejected our emptied magazines and quickly pushed new ones home. Clicks and metallic noises filled the air. Clarence threaded his last coil of ammunition belt into the GPMG as we stepped out, drawing our axes, and started moving between the corpses, using our torches to seek out the still-living zombies. Their groaning and shuffling noises made them easy to find, and we stalked through the bodies, chopping heads off and cutting throats open. Mr Howie! Nick calls my attention and points to the gate opening up. All of us turn and stand ready as a well-built young man walks out. He looks round at the bodies and then straight at me, walking steadily with a pistol in his hand down at his side. A young woman steps out behind him and walks forward. More young people gather in the gap created by the open gate, but they hold there. Hey, you the man from the tower? I call out. Yeah, he replies, his voice low and deep, his tone as wary as his movements, which are fluid and powerful, but aloof and ready for action. I'm Howie. Nice to meet you. I step towards him and hold my hand out. He pauses, looking me up and down, then across at the rest of my group. A decision made, and he steps in closer, extending his hand to shake. Maddox. He nods, and up close I can see how young he is, maybe 18 or 19 at the most, but his eyes are deeply intelligent and his grip has power. This is Lensky, he nods behind him at the very attractive young lady stepping carefully over the bodies. She stops next to Maddox, and I extend my hand to her. Lensky, I'm Howie. These people are with me. We mean you no harm. We're not a threat to you. We're just passing through. I want to reassure them quickly, knowing that with over a hundred terrified children inside, they must be deeply worried. It's good to meet you, Howie, she replies in a clipped Polish accent. So are you the only adults here? I ask. Kind of. Maddox replies, and I can see he's still very wary. Listen, mate, we're going to sort these out and make sure they're all dead. There might be some injured people out here. Have you got a first aid station or medical bay here? No, he replies simply. Okay, have you got bandages and clean water, something we can use to patch them up, maybe some lights? We have these. I get them and make the lights ready, Lenski says with a pointed look at Maddox. I'll get some of my lot out here to help clear this up, Maddox says. He turns back to the open gate. Jagger, take the left side. Mohammed, take the right. Sierra and Liam, I want your crews down the main road ahead. Ryland, get into the units and get some lights out here, bruv. Skylar, find Lenski and get water and bandages up here into the street. Bloody hell, Cookie exclaims at seeing groups of youths pour from the gates. Young kids armed to the teeth with knives and sharp sticks, bats, swords and poles. A few bigger kids direct them with short words of order and they move about in sections, dropping down and shooing bodies over, slitting throats, clubbing heads and bursting skulls apart. They rifle pockets and loot the bodies, searching for anything usable. We all stand shocked and stunned, unable to take our eyes off these children doing the bloody work of killers. The fact that they're ordered really stands out. They smile and joke with each other, and the banter reminds me of how we are when we operate and move together.
and I notice they keep staring and glancing at us, but the faces become hard and unsmiling when they look at us. Not scared, not terrified little children, but the same wary aloofness that Maddox had. What the fuck? Nick mutters. This is one strange day, Lani adds in the same muted tone. A proud-looking girl leads a group of children across the junction, heading into the shadows of the street opposite. One of the smaller children stares in awe at Clarence as he passes by. You is henchbruv, the child says in a strong, confident tone, and turns away as the others start sniggering and pointing at Clarence. Did we just save a bunch of gangster kids from a nice group of survivors being eaten by a horde of zombies? Cookie asks. Possibly, I reply quietly, not quite believing what my eyes are showing me. Within minutes, there are injured bodies being dragged past us through the open gates and dumped on the street beyond. The children dragging them race back out and grab more injured people. The youths on the street inside the gates examine each body closely with torches, checking for bite wounds. Any that are suspicious are killed instantly and without any sign of mercy or pity. Generators get carried into the street. Then lighting units plugged in and glowing bright as soon as the generators are started. The street floods with light and I see Lensky and other girls carrying bottles of water and dumping them down onto the road. Boxes filled with sealed bandages get brought up along with boxes of disposable gloves. Howie. Maddox walks back out the gate straight towards me. My crews will sort this out from here. We'll get the injured cared for. Uh, that's good, mate. What's in your compound? How do I answer that? Maddox replies bluntly. What? I mean, what is in there that these people wanted so badly? They launched an attack at a base full of children. Why, Maddox? We didn't ask for your help, Howie, he replies with a defiant stare. Maddox, mate, we're not here to take anything from you. We got a place down the coast from here. We got food, medicines and safety. Now, why were these people attacking you? Who are you, brov? Maddox flares up with an angry tone, his voice making the other seven members of my group take a step towards him. The response was a hundred or so children, tooled up and looking mean, gathering quickly and quietly all around us. Looking round, I saw my group sliding their axes away and slowly pulling assault rifles round. Stand easy, I wave them down. We are not shooting children. Dave, listen to me, we are not shooting children. Got it? Yes, Mr Howie. He answers quickly, as I know he won't hesitate if he thinks the group is threatened. He'd drown kittens if he felt any of us were at risk. Maddox, I asked you a simple and open question. We are not a threat to you, and we do not need anything from you, but after what we just did, I feel we're owed an explanation as to why these adults were attacking a compound full of children. We didn't ask for your help. Go home. This is our place. He stands full on and stares hard. Don't tell me to go home, mate. I can feel the first bite of anger rising up. I'm not after your place or anything that's inside it. I want to know why they were attacking you. What do you have that they need? You get me, bruv? This is our place. Who are you to come here and demand answers? You ain't nothing. Yeah, thanks for the help, but we got this now. Don't fucking dismiss me like I'm some idiot. My voice rises in volume and I start walking towards him. What did you do to make them come at you like this? Who the fuck are you to question us? You passing through, so pass through. Go home and leave us. He walks towards me a few steps, showing me his open hands. Why are they attacking you, Maddox? What did you do to them? Don't question me, bruv. Go home. You will answer my fucking question or I will tear this place apart with my bare hands. What did you do to them? Did you rob them? Did you take their food and supplies? Answer me. I answer to no one, he bellows back. This is my place, and I make the rules here. You ain't no one. I want to know why we just fired on people. Not just those things, but people. You've got kids here, so why are these people attacking you? We didn't ask for your help, he roars back at me, spittle flying from his mouth. But we gave it, thinking you have scared kids in here. You took these people's things, didn't you? You took their food and supplies, didn't you? Get fucked, he sneers. This conversation is over. Go about your business. He turns to walk away, 
and the fury erupts from me as I stride towards him. He spins round, pulling a pistol from his belt. Instinctively, I grab mine and lift it up as I sidestep out. Two men holding pistols at each other from a few feet away. Assault rifles get cocked behind me. Voices call out. The distinctive sound of rifle bolts being racked back. A cacophony of sound as everyone gears up for a fight. Stand down, Maddox, I growl at him. You stand down, he growls back. No, stop this, Lenski screams from behind Maddox. Boss, this isn't our fight, Clarence shouts. These are just kids, boss. I get the pleading tone in his voice, and I glance round to see him holding the heavy machine gun pointing at masses of children. Rifles and shotguns are pointed at my group, kids with knives and bats all converging and creeping in. Howie, we need to go, Lani shouts with alarm in her voice. Maddox and I face off with our pistols pointing at each other. If I drop my aim, he'll shoot me, and then everyone will open up, and then everyone will be dead. Maddox, listen to me. No, you listen. This is our place, and you don't come here in our backyard making demands. You ain't the feds, bruv. We got this place now. We don't want your fucking place, Maddox. Then go! Okay, take it easy. We'll go. Everyone listen up. We are going. So nobody shoot. I shout to make everyone hear me, backing away but keeping the pistol raised, honestly believing that if I lower it, he'll go for a shot. The prize of our weapons for his compound would be too tempting. Yeah, you go, Maddox stalks after me. Keep going and don't come back here. This doesn't have to be this way, Maddox. We got a community too, a few miles down the coast at Fort Spitbank. We got food, doctors, medicines, safety and order. You don't have to live like this. Like what? He smiles. You see us struggling, bruv? We got food, medicines and safety right here. You can't kill other survivors for food, Maddox. There's no way back from that, mate. Look at what you did here. These people attacked a secure compound full of children for fuck's sake. The only reason they did that was because of what you did to them. You don't know this, he shouts. These people are vermin. They want to take food from children. They're greedy. Backing away, I reach my group and we start walking back down the road we came from. All of us pointing our weapons at the children as they stalk after us. Some of them, smiling and laughing like it's a game, goading each other and shouting insults. Maddox, we're leaving. Call your people off. Just keep going, bruv. Don't tell me what to do. Maddox, listen to Howie. Back off and stand down. Your kids are itching to start and we've got bloody big guns here, son. Don't risk it, Clarence shouts, his deep voice carrying clearly down the road. Maddox, let them go now. Lenski pushes through the crowd of kids and reaches out to pull Maddox back, his arm still extended with the pistol pointing at me. Surprisingly, he stops and allows the girl to pull him back. She looks angry and scared. Lenski, we're going, I shout over to her. We're at Fort Spitbank. Remember that, Fort Spitbank. We've got doctors and safety. We can take people in. I remember this, she shouts back. You go and I remember this. Lenski, we need a vehicle, Clarence shouts. A what? Car, we need a car or a van, anything. I not know this, she implores, then turns to whisper fiercely at Maddox. A heated exchange of words takes place, but watching Maddox, I can see he is clearly listening to her. Maddox, do the right thing, mate. We'll be gone quicker with a vehicle. Behind the shop, two roads over. There's a dog shit bin there. The keys are in the bin. You've got 20 minutes to go. You still here after that? We're coming for you. You get me? Take it easy, Maddox. We're going, mate. No one needs to get hurt now. I shout back. Use the ones getting fucked up in it. Swear down, we'll fuck you up. Another youth shouts over. More join in. Cat calls, whistles and goading. These kids are fearless and it just makes us back away quickly. Taking care not to trip over the bodies of the undead we fell just a short time earlier. A few minutes later and we're walking steadily along in our group, weapons still at the ready but the youths now long gone. What the fuck was that? Clarence says quietly. Different rules, I guess. Fucking hell, did you see them kids? Tooled up and just itching for a scrap, I reply with a shake of my head. We move in silence after that. All of us shocked at the turn of events. We saw a horde of undead attacking something and charged in. But the boundaries have been blurred. 
feral kids killing people and taking their stuff. Now those people are dead and those kids are secure within a gated commune. We all know we just played a part in helping the bad guys win, but then they're still just kids. Shit, this is confusing, I sigh. I don't know if we did a bad thing or a good thing. We killed a lot of those things. That's a good thing, Dave says flatly. But did we just give more power to little gangster shits that are already fucking everyone over? Cookie asks seriously. Dave stares ahead, then seems to realise that Cookie was asking him the question. I don't know, Alex, Dave says. We saw the zombies and we killed them. That's it. The rest is just people being people. We can't be everywhere and make everyone have the same values as us. Good words, Dave, I add with respect. Now let's get the fuck out of here and quickly, before those little shits change their mind and decide they want our guns. 27. What in your head? Lenski says with worry lines etched onto her face. Maddox stares into the dark road. Every member of the compound gathered behind him as he searches the shadows for any sign of them. A contrary feeling rises in his soul that everything was going right. He was on the right track. They saved the compound, so why didn't he show gratitude? Why didn't he back down and welcome them? Show them what they were planning and what ideas he had? They said they had another commune with doctors and food, and that meant stability. They had proper weapons and moved like a unit too. He could have joined forces with them, traded supplies for weapons. But that attitude, that instant assumption that they were feral little gangster chav shits running riot and killing everyone, that had been true, but it wasn't now. Maddox felt conflicted and a sense of shame. But more than anything, he knew this had ended badly. If they were good people, then they would come back under the misguided banner of trying to save the kids, or trying to save the people on the estate. If they weren't good people, they would see that the compound held food and supplies. Either way, they'll come back. That righteous attitude, demanding answers, white men with guns trying to throw their weight around and be the new law and order. Those days were gone. Maddox was going to change the way they did things, and it wasn't his fault the survivors decided to attack tonight. This was new times, new rules. Maddox, I ask, what in your head? Lenski asked again. He turned to look at her, seeing the fear and confusion in her face. He knew what needed to be done, whatever it cost to survive. New times, new rules. Darius, take three crews and go left. Go after them. Jagger, you take three more and go right. Mohammed, you go straight and keep behind them. Liam, you stay and hold the base secure. We go after them. I want them weapons. Take them at the shops where all the roads meet. Maddox barked the orders out, hardly believing he was doing this. But the way that man shouted at him, the sneer on his face and the anger in his eyes, he wouldn't forget and he would come back with more men. This had to end here. No, Maddox, this is wrong. You not do this. Lenski grabbed his arm, begging him to stop the youths as they instantly split and went off different directions, melting into the shadows and racing after the armed group. Go back to the compound and wait there. Maddox pulled his arm free. No, they help you. They save us, Maddox. Why you do this? They have safe place with doctors and medicine. We should work with them, not fight. They'll come back and try to take this Lenski. They'll see these kids as a threat and try to end what we have. They'll tell people we're here and others will come. The compound with a hundred children. Every survivor with a gun will try and get in. We got to stop that. This wrong. These men, they try to help you. They help us, Maddox. Go back, Linsky. Maddox pulled free and jogged after Mohammed and his crew, moving quickly down the road. Lenski fell to her knees, hands clutching her face, tears rolling down her cheeks as the sobs racked her body. They were so close, so close to doing it properly. Good people came to help them. She knew the way Maddox and the others viewed outsiders and any form of authority. But these were good people. She could tell by the way they worked together. They were clean and healthy, with good clothes and good weapons. They had a safe place with doctors. These children needed that kind of help. What happens when one of them breaks a leg, gets the measles, cuts themselves on a nasty nail? Those things meant death without medicine and trained people. Everything they worked for, everything they planned was going. Unless she did something, 
persuaded Malix to listen, made him listen, got that man Howie to listen. She had to try. Rubbing the tears from her face, she gets to her feet and starts moving off. Linsky, Maddox said you had to go back, Liam quickly called out, watching her form a few feet away and feeling confused and worried at seeing her cry. Liam, go to the compound now, Lensky turned and shouted. Her harsh tones stopped him in his tracks as she fled into the dark shadows. 28. Shops. Dave pointed ahead to a collection of commercial buildings set into the side of the road next to a large junction. About bloody time, Cookie muttered. We ran forward, using the moonlight to pick our route. Reaching the shops, we hunted round and found a small service road running behind them. Taking the road, we jogged to the back of the shops and a long line of cars and vans parked up tight behind the shops. Look at that, Blower said, shining his torch on the wall at the spray-painted letters. Boss man vehicles. Touch and die. Nice, Nick shook his head. I thought you couldn't read. Cookie asked innocently. I can't read very well, but I can read that, Nick replied without any offence. Dog shit bin is here, Blowers said from across the road, shining his light on the distinctive red plastic refuse bin. He lifted the lid gingerly, clearly expecting to find the thing full of shit. Someone had taped the keys to the underside of the lid, all of them hanging down. Bloody hell, these kids have got some influence leaving them here with the keys right there, Blowers said. We need a van, I called out, scanning the vehicles. There's a few here. Press the clickers and see which one lights up. On it, Blowers reached his hand in and started pushing the raised nodules. Indicators flashed with clunking noises as cars were unlocked. That one, Lani shouts as a white van clunks open with the orange lights flashing. Get in, I'll drive, I call out as Lani and Tom start pulling the side and rear doors open. Running over, I clamber into the driver's seat as Blowers passes me the keys. Contact! Dave roars. A shot rings out. A rifle shot from somewhere at the front of the shops, immediately followed by shotgun blasts and more rifles. The windows of the vehicle start exploding as I ram the ignition key in and twist it round. The van lurches forward, slamming into the vehicle in front. Fuck, it wasn't gear, sorry, I say through gritted teeth, and turn the key back round, then press the clutch down as I start it again. The van ticks over for a few seconds, then fires up with the noisy diesel engine sputtering into the night. Dave, get in, I shout through the open door, watching as he runs down the service road and dives into the open rear doors. Are we all in? Yes, go, Blowers and Clarence both shout. I select reverse and slam the van backwards, impacting into the vehicle behind. Twisting the wheel over hard, I start to ease forward as more shots ring out and the windscreen implodes, showering me in glass fragments. Leaning over to the side, I press the pedal down and scrape the van out from its position. Shots impact into the side of the van as I drive down the service road and I feel a wheel blowing out, causing the van to tilt down and veer off to the side. Fighting to control the vehicle, I navigate the corner and glance up to look out the hole where the windscreen was. My heart sinks at the sight of youth spread all over the place. Missiles start thudding against the vehicle as rocks, stones and bricks get launched at us. They're fucking everywhere, I scream out. Keep going, Dave shouts back. Then his head appears between the seats, assault rifle in hand. He glances up and quickly scans the route ahead. Go faster, Mr Howie, he urges. I can't, mate. Wheel's blown out. This is my top speed. My foot is pressed down, and the van is roaring with power, but the rubber must have been shredded from the wheel, causing the drum to spin and gouge into the tarmac. We're going no faster than walking pace. Get ready! We'll have to fight our way out! Dave shouts at the figures lying in the back of the van. I'm not shooting kids, Clarence shouts. Clarence, they are going to kill us! Dave shouts. I can't shoot kids, he replies. I can, Dave says bluntly. I look down and lock eyes with the small, quiet man. An absolute killer stares back at me. A monster, but he's our monster. They're not negotiating, Clarence. They're fucking shooting at us, Blower shouts. I can't do it, he roars. I won't do it. I'll fucking die before I shoot a child. I'm a fucking soldier, not a murderer. And so are you. This isn't our way. Shots ping into the side of the van. Fewer now, but more missiles get thrown as loud thunks bang off the metal sides. Then suggest something, 
I plead with him. Let me fire, Dave growls. No, Clarence roars. If you fire on those kids, I'll fucking shoot you, Dave. What then? I scream in desperation. We give up and give them what they want. Surrender, Clarence spits the last word out. Never, Dave roars. Dave, we are not shooting children. We give up and let them have the weapons. They'll kill us, he shouts in reply. They'll kill the lads and Mr Howie. Clarence, this isn't the army. This is different times. Mr Howie has to survive. Why? Why me? Because, Dave roars, and I swear the van shakes from the emotion in his voice. Because what? I shout back. Clarence, you do this and I swear I'll fucking kill them all, Dave roars. Dave, this isn't the way, mate, Clarence shouts back, his tone softer now. We are not child killers. We don't do that. Dave, please listen to him, Lani shouts. We can't kill them. They are fucking shooting at us, Cookie shouts. Mr Howie, you're the boss, Blowers cuts everyone else down. What you say goes. If you say we fight, then we fight. If you say surrender, then we do that without argument. Dave, Clarence prompts him. Do you hear that? Howie is boss here. What he says goes. I will not let them kill him. That will not happen. It's my choice, Dave. You abide by my order. Do you hear me? Mr Howie, he growls in reply. Dave, you abide my order. Do you hear me? Yes, Mr Howie, he barks. We surrender. You shout that now. You shout it loud, Dave, and make them hear. He pauses, our eyes locked. Then he draws breath and bellows out. Cease firing. We surrender. Cease firing. We surrender. Shouts from outside, and gradually the shots and thumps end as the word is spread. I ease my foot off the pedal, and the van instantly stops and cuts out. The only sounds are the engine cooling down with light clicks and clunks. Mr Howie, I'll charge and distract them. You run and get away. Dave pleads with me, his eyes wide. It's the first time I've ever seen fear in his face. No, Dave, I smile back. Clarence is right. We don't kill kids. I won't kill them, I promise. I'll fight with my hands, and I promise I won't kill any. Dave, they'll tear you apart. There's over a hundred of them. That's fine with me, Mr Howie, but you've got to get away. You have to survive. His eyes beg me, his tone soft and pleading. I'll fight with him, Mr Howie, Blowers adds. Me too, Cookie says. And me, Nick says softly. What? What the fuck has got into you? We do this together. I'm not running and leaving you to die. This isn't your day to die, Mr Howie, Dave continues. You must survive and... And what, Dave? Blurs, what is this? You have to live, Mr Howie, Blurs says, matter of fact. You lead and others follow. We wouldn't have that fought without you. We wouldn't have survived without you. It's not us, Mr Howie, it's you. Others will follow you and you can lead them. You have to survive. Fuck off! I spit the words out in shock. Boss, you do one and get away. We've got this, Clarence adds. Not you too, Clarence. You just said you wouldn't kill kids. I won't kill them, but I can fucking batter them about for a bit. You're all nuts. No, no, not happening. We stay together. If they go for you, I swear I'll end them, Dave curses. No, you won't, Dave. You promised me, and that means something. Come out with your hands up, Maddox's voice screams out. Coming! Do not shoot, I shout back. Do not shoot. We will not fire on you. Boss, take the chance and go, Clarence urges. Don't ask me that again, any of you. Not ever. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? I get murmurs of reply and look back to see Lani staring at me with an intense expression. Suddenly the thought of them hurting her bites me inside. And I want to ask her to go, to run away like they said I should. But I know what the response will be. Come on. Weapons down. I shrug my pistol from my belt and lay it on the seat and push the door open slowly before clambering out with my hands held high. We are not armed! I shout clearly and walk slowly round to the side door, pulling it back and watching as my group files out one at a time, hands held high. Dave, did you leave your knives? I ask him quietly. Yes, he answers sulkily. All of them? I've got one, he answers instantly. Small one in my boot. 
Okay, keep that one then. I only say it for fear of him suddenly reaching down to his boot and causing a reaction from the youths. Maddox strides forwards, the pistol held high and pointing at us. Youths gathered behind him, pointing rifles and shotguns in our direction. We stay quiet as they converge, coming in close and surrounding us. You will shoot each other, Clarence says. What? Maddox snaps the pistol round to point it up at the big man. You've got guns surrounding us. If you all fire, you will shoot each other. You need one line in front and none behind. What the fuck? Maddox looks confused. He's right, Dave adds. Arcs of fire, basic skills. Move to the front. Maddox gives the order and waits while everyone shuffles round. Shit, look at this bitch. A stocky lad pulls the heavy machine gun from the van, holding it in both hands while the youths stare in awe. Be careful, son, the safety might not be on. Please check it, Clarence rumbles. Why are you doing this? Maddox suddenly demands. Doing what? I ask him, knowing full well what he means. Why are you giving up, bruv? You've got guns, you've got weapons and skills, you could fight. We don't kill children, Clarence replies for me. That's not our way, son. Stop calling me son, Maddox shouts. I'm old and you are young. It's a natural thing for me to say. I don't shout when you call me bruv, do I? We would have killed you. I told them to kill you, he says, with anger still in his voice. So kill us, I reply. We're here without weapons. You got the guns. Go ahead. This ain't some movie, Maddox says through gritted teeth. Ain't no smart speech gonna save you now. Get down on your knees, all of you. No, I reply with a dull tone. Get down, he shouts, and waves the pistol an inch from my face. No, we won't kill children, so we surrendered. But not one of us will beg or kneel in front of you. That bitch is well fit, one of the loud shouts from the massed ranks, clearly meaning Lani. What's your manners? Maddox turns and shouts, surprising all of us. Was that you, Jermaine? You're on toilet duty for the next week. Sorry, Maddox, the lad replies in a humble tone, while the rest of us cast confused glances at each other. Maddox, we have been fighting every day since this thing started. That's ten solid days of fighting. We've killed tens of thousands of those things. We've slaughtered them with guns and with our bare hands. If we wanted to fight, you would all be dead. All of you. My voice snaps his attention round. But we didn't, because you were children. Nasty little shits, yes, but still children. We have honour and integrity, and we draw a line at that. I'm not a child, he sneers. No, Maddox, you are clearly not a child, mate. But the rest are, and even if we killed you, it would mean having to kill them, which we won't do. How old are you? Lois asks. Eighteen, Maddox answers quickly. You look older, Nick adds. You been to prison? Cookie asks. What? What the fuck is this? He spits. You're massive for an eighteen-year-old. I heard they got good gyms in prison. Cause I'm black, you think I've been in prison? He shouts. No, mate, cause you're big, packed with muscle, and you're from a council estate, it figures. Cookie replies with an easy tone. Did he go to prison then? Maddox waves the pistol at Clarence. Nah, he's just a freak, Cookie jokes. Eats everything. Snores like a fucking bear, too, Nick adds as I smile at the disarming banter. One of the lad's best weapons, and they know it. I bet Blowers would like prison, Cookie says softly. Oh, fuck off, Blowers sighs. All them men in showers, Nick joins in. Oh, did I drop the soap? Let me bend over and pick it up. Fuck off, Blowers exclaims, rolling his eyes. Get this every bloody day, he shakes his head at Maddox. Where's Lenski? Lani asks. What? What the... I am here! She pushes through the youths to stand just behind Maddox. Hi. Lani nods at the woman. Hello, she replies, then stares at Maddox with her arms folded. Well, you kill them now, yes? This is what we do now, yes? We kill everyone. So kill! She shrugs at him, her face blank. Linsky, he says. What? Look at them. They surrender without the fight. Look at their guns. They could kill all of us. Why didn't they do this? Are you two a couple? Lani asks. Yes, Lenski replies quickly, and I notice the youths looking at each other in surprise. 
We are, but maybe not for long. Her voice trails off as Maddox stares at her. What are you worried about, Maddox? I ask him. That we'll come back and get revenge. That we'll try and save these kids. Mate, these kids can look after themselves. And as for revenge, no offence, but that's not on our plan. There's probably hundreds of communes and places like this around the country. We're going back to our fort. And the only thing we're interested in is killing those things. I couldn't take that risk, he replies. Everyone will see us as weak, a base full of kids. Maddox, we've been all over the place. Those things are everywhere, all over the country. People are the rare species now. We've got no interest in your compound. We've got a bloody great big fort of our own. I was trying to tell you before. You were demanding to know why those people attacked us. Yeah, and maybe I was wrong to do that. But, mate, killing people for their food is bad. Maddox was not in charge at this time, no? The boss man, he make these rules and he give the children the drugs. The boss man, he tried to kill Maddox, but Maddox killed him and now he in charge. He said yesterday, no more killing, no more of the drugs. He made the fence out there. He stopped the children taking the drugs. He said to plant the food and make the crops, yes? The boss man, he did the bad things, but Maddox, he tried to fix this. But only in last day. We need time to fix this, Lenski implored, looking between Maddox and I. This true? I ask him. Yeah, he replies. Why didn't you say before? Not your business, he shrugs. Maddox, these are new times. I understand your suspicion and concern, but I think we've proved ourselves now. Yeah. He suddenly looks defeated and slumps his shoulders. I realise the youths are looking at him with concerned expressions. Their leader lost for words. The fight gone out of him. I glance over at Clarence, nodding at him to say something. Uh, so what are you benching? He asks. I stare at him with a look of horror and mouth, what the fuck? He shrugs apologetically. I don't know, he mouths back. What? Maddox shakes his head and looks at Clarence. Must be well over a hundred kilos, big lad like you. Yeah, his voice trailed off. Let them go. Give them their weapons back and let them go. He waves at the youths holding our assault rifles, who suddenly look crestfallen. Ah, oh, Maddox! One of them whines and gets a sharp look from Lenski. Reluctantly, the youths hand the weapons back, and I watch my group taking their rifles and checking magazines, pushing pistols back into their belt holsters. Dave moves into the van and starts pushing the knives back into his belt. Rucksacks get pulled out and swapped about. I take mine and shove my axe down the back before taking my assault rifle from Nick all the time watching Maddox slouch away quietly with Lenski at his side. Wait here, I say to the others and start moving after him. Maddox, wait up, mate. What? He turns quickly to watch me approaching. You okay? You look like shit. Tired, he replies gruffly. Take it easy, mate. If what Lenski said was true, then you're doing the right thing. But you can't give up and sulk in front of everyone like that. Well, I ain't sulking. He replies quickly. Just can't do it. Everyone looks up to you, mate. You've got to lead them. They look confused now. It's hard, he answers, quietly showing just how young he really is. I thought I was doing the right thing, but then I sent them after you. That was a bad decision, so maybe I'm not doing the right thing. Everyone makes mistakes, mate. That was a bad one, admittedly, but it's done now, and you've recovered it. Move on and stick to the plan you had. It sounded a good one to me. Anyway, your estate is now pretty much cleared out. More might come, but keep patrols out on the perimeters and keep checking. Have fallback points and make sure you've got an escape route out of your compound. Go through the houses and secure everything you need. If you find other survivors, protect them. They'll be older and can teach you things. I don't know everything, but i got a good team and they help with everything we do. Also, I'm warming up now. Get those vehicles closer to your compound. They're a valuable commodity now. Don't waste ammunition either. And get some medical books or something. You can't leave it to chance with all those kids in one place. We're a few miles down the coast. You send someone if you need help. If we can spare it, we'll send what we can. Ask for Howie or Big Chris. Yeah, thanks, he nods. Uh, you too. If we can help with anything, then just ask. That might just happen, mate. You've got a huge estate here that could easily be fenced in and secured. Just don't be alarmed if that happens and people come here. And don't kill them.
We, we won't, Howie, and I'm sorry for attacking you. It's done. But for the record, you don't know how close you came to losing everything. These people in my group are nasty bastards if they get pissed off. It was good to meet you, Maddox. I hold my hand out, which he takes in a firm grip and smiles at me. A smile full of youth and future and white teeth. You too, Lensky. I shake hands with the woman who stares with rapture at Maddox. Take it easy. I turn and walk away, back to my group. Oh, and can we have another vehicle? Yeah, take what you need, just bring it back, Maddox laughs. That's a deal, mate. I nod and head over to my group, stood talking to the youths. The lads all trading jokes and banter with the kids. Clarence talking to some stockier lads about weight training, and Lani staring with revulsion at a 16-year-old girl with a huge cleavage poking out from her low-cut top. We're off, I shout over. Again? Lani smiles. Yeah, again. 29. Maddox watches Howie walking away and glances over to the crews crowding round the men with guns. Shaking his head, he sighs deeply and feels an overwhelming sense of shame at what almost happened. How he misread the situation and nearly risked the lives of so many more people. Shit, this stuff is complicated, he says to Lensky. Yes, she replies simply. I'm sorry, he adds. Twice now in the last few minutes he's apologised for his actions, something he very rarely does. I know, again she replies simply. He terrified her with his actions, with his thirst for action and violence, only it wasn't that. He was terrified too, scared of those men coming back and hurting the kids. Lensky knows that's why he went after them, and for that loyalty to the kids she can forgive the dangerous and stupid action he took. What now? she asks. We carry on, I guess. He scratches the side of his head with the end of the pistol, then realises what he's doing and quickly shoves the gun away, tutting at himself. That Howie had some good advice, perimeters and stuff. We should find their base so we know the place it is in, yes? If we need doctor or something, we can get there quickly then. Okay, he nods back, staring down at the ground. She moves in close and entwines her fingers in his and waits until he lifts his head. Then she kisses him. In full view of nearly every crew from the compound, they kiss passionately, breaking away and looking round at the sea of young faces, watching them quietly. What are you looking at? Maddox shouts suddenly, making them jump. He grins quickly, then laughs at the surprised looks on their faces. Everyone back, we got a lot of work to do. What's up? Darius asks, stepping in next to Maddox as they walk slowly back to the compound. Nothing, you? Nothing. Darius pauses for a minute, then looks over at his friend. I'm glad we didn't kill them, he adds quietly. Me too, Jagger says from behind them both. Maddox turns to see Mohammed and more crew chiefs all nodding agreement. Then why did you shoot at them? Why go after them? Because you said so, bruv. You the boss man now, Maddox, what you says, it goes, innit? Mohammed says. Maddox stops and stares at the chiefs. I got it wrong, you get me? I fucked up and read it wrong. If I do that again, you gotta say something. I ain't the boss man. This ain't no tyranny with a ruler at the top who always gets what he wants. You's gotta step up and say something if you think I'm wrong. I might not agree, but I'll listen, you get me? I can't do everything. Yeah? We get you, Maddox, Sierra replies in a serious tone. So are you and Lensky going out now? She asks, still showing the need to know the structure and the hierarchy. Yeah, we are, Maddox replies with a smile. That's sweet, Maddox, Sierra beams at him. So is she still number two or is she number one with you? What? Maddox shakes his head at the convoluted logic. If she's number one, then that means Darius is number two and I'm with Darius and that makes me number two too. So someone got to be number three. And four, Jagger added. Maddox shook his head for a few long seconds, staring as the chief started talking about who the number three and four should be. The funny thing was, he could see the reasoning and knew they'd want the numbers all the way to the bottom. We got to get back, he says. Liam needs to be told he's now number three. He turned with a big smile as the chiefs stunned into silence for a second, erupted into loud arguments. 
Oh, you bad man, Linsky laughed. Taking his hand, they walked side by side back towards the compound. Their compound. 30. We take another van from behind the shops and load up. I drive again, but this time Lani sits up front in the passenger seat. Making idle chat, we get lost several times and bicker our way through the confusing estate, making comments that even taxi drivers must find this place confusing. Eventually, we find our way back to the shore and our rib sat forlorn on the beach. Dave gets us back into the house and we load the van up with our looted gear. Finally, a few hours before dawn, we move off. Driving back through the estate and getting lost a few more times until we find a motorway on the northern edge. After that, it's a sedate pace and the conversation becomes muted and quiet. What happened here? Lani asks as we drive slowly down the country lane towards the ruined landscape of the housing estate, bordering the wide open flat lands. Dave, Cookie says with a smile. He blow it up. Really? She asks Dave who stares back and nods once. We still haven't talked about that conversation we had in the van, why I'm so special and need to survive, but we will. For now, though, the fort is only a few miles away. Safety and comfort, food and rest. Big Chris and Doc Roberts, Sergeant Hopewell and Ted. Look at that, Lani exclaims, leaning forwards. The lads group behind the seats, and we look in silence at the soft lights on the fort in the distance. Just small orange glows that seem to hover in the air. It fills us all with a profound sense of coming home. To our compound. Our fort. Home. Thank you for listening to The Undead Part 5 Day 10 by R. R. Haywood. Read by Dan Morgan. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.